Interesting Times by Terry Pratchett, read by Nigel Planer. This is where the gods play games with the lives of men, on a board which is at one and the same time a simple playing area and the whole world. And fate always wins. Fate always wins. Most of the gods throw dice, but fate plays chess. And you don't find out until too late that he's been using two queens all along. Fate wins. At least, so it is claimed. Whatever happens, they say afterwards, it must have been fate. People are always a little confused about this, as they are in the case of miracles. When someone is saved from certain death by a strange concatenation of circumstances, they say, that's a miracle. But of course, if someone is killed by a freak chain of events, the oil spilled just there, the safety fence broken just there, that must also be a miracle. Just because it's not nice doesn't mean it's not miraculous. Gods can take any form, but the one aspect of themselves they cannot change is their eyes, which show their nature. The eyes of fate are hardly eyes at all, just dark holes into an infinity speckled with what may be stars, or there again, may be other things. He blinked them, smiled at his fellow players in the smug way winners do just before they become winners, and said, I accuse the high priest of the green robe in the library with the double-handed axe. And he won. He beamed at them. No one likes a poor winner, grumbled Offler, the crocodile god, through his fangs. It seems that I am favouring myself today, said fate. Anyone fancy something else? The gods shrugged. Mad kings, said fate pleasantly. Star-crossed lovers. I think we've lost the rules for that one, said blind Eo, chief of the gods. Or tempest-wrecked mariners. You always win, said Eo. Floods and droughts, said fate. That's an easy one. A shadow fell across the gaming table. The gods looked up. Ah, said fate. Let a game begin, said the lady. There was always an argument about whether the newcomer was a goddess at all. Certainly no one ever got anywhere by worshipping her, and she tended to turn up only when she was least expected, such as now. And people who trusted in her seldom survived. Any temples built to her would surely be struck by lightning. Better to juggle axes on a tightrope than say her name. Just call her the waitress in the last chance saloon. She was generally referred to as the lady, and her eyes were green. Not as the eyes of humans are green, but emerald green from edge to edge. It was said to be her favourite colour. Ah, said fate again. And what game will it be? She sat down opposite him. The watching gods looked sidelong at one another. This looked interesting. These two were ancient enemies. How about, she paused, mighty empires? Oh, I hate that one, said Offler, breaking the sudden silence. Everyone dies at the end. Yes, said Fate, I believe they do. He nodded at the lady, and in much the same voice as professional gamblers say, Ace is high, said, The fall of great houses, destinies of nations hanging by a thread. Certainly, she said. Oh, Good. Fate waved a hand across the board. The disc world appeared. And where shall we play, he said. The counterweight continent, said the lady, where five noble families have fought one another for centuries. Really? Which families are these, said Eo. He had little involvement with individual humans. He generally looked after thunder and lightning, so from his point of view the only purpose of humanity was to get wet, or, in occasional cases, charred. The Hongs, the Sungs, the Tangs, the McSweenies, and the Fangs. Them? I didn't know they were noble, said Eo. They're all very rich, and have had millions of people butchered or tortured to death merely for reasons of expediency and pride, said the lady. The watching gods nodded solemnly. That was certainly noble behaviour. That was exactly what they would have done. McQueenie, said Offler. A very old established family, said Fate. Oh. 
And they wrestle one another for the Empire, said Fate. Very good. Which will you be? The lady looked at the history stretched out in front of them. The Hongs are the most powerful. Even as we speak, they have taken yet more cities, she said. I see they are fated to win. So, no doubt you'll pick a weaker family. Fate waved his hand again. The playing pieces appeared and started to move around the board as if they had a life of their own, which was, of course, the case. But, he said, we shall play without dice. I don't trust you with dice. You throw them where I can't see them. We will play with steel and tactics and politics and war. The lady nodded. Fate looked across at his opponent. And your move, he said. She smiled. I've already made it. He looked down. But I don't see your pieces on the board. They're not on the board yet, she said. She opened her hand. There was something black and yellow on her palm. She blew on it, and it unfolded its wings. It was a butterfly. Fate always wins. At least, when people stick to the rules. According to the philosopher Lee Tin Weedle, chaos is found in greatest abundance wherever order is being sought. It always defeats order because it's better organized. This is the butterfly of the storms. See the wings, slightly more ragged than those of the common fritillary. In reality, thanks to the fractal nature of the universe, this means that those ragged edges are infinite, in the same way that the edge of any rugged coastline, when measured to the ultimate microscopic level, is infinitely long, or if not infinite, then at least so close to it that infinity can be seen on a clear day. And therefore, if their edges are infinitely long, the wings must logically be infinitely big. They may look about the right size for a butterfly's wings, but that's only because human beings have always preferred common sense to logic. The quantum weather butterfly, Papilio tempesti, is an undistinguished yellow color, although the Mandelbrot patterns on the wings are of considerable interest. Its outstanding feature is its ability to create weather. This presumably began as a survival trait, since even an extremely hungry bird would find itself inconvenienced by a nasty localized tornado, usually about six inches across. From there, it possibly became a secondary sexual characteristic, like the plumage of birds or the throat sacs of certain frogs. Look at me, the male says, flapping his wings lazily in the canopy of the rainforest. I may be an undistinguished yellow color, but in a fortnight's time, a thousand miles away, freak gales cause road chaos. This is the butterfly of the storms. It flaps its wings. This is the disc world, which goes through space on the back of a giant turtle. Most worlds do at some time in their perception. It's a cosmological view the human brain seems pre-programmed to take. On veldt and plain, in cloud jungle and silent red desert, in swamp and reed marsh, in fact, in any place where something goes plop off a floating log as you approach, variations on the following take place, at a crucial early point in the development of the tribal mythology. You see that? What? It just went plop off that log. Yeah, well, I reckon, I reckon like, I reckon the world is carried on the back of one of them. A moment of silence while the astrophysical hypothesis is considered, and then... The whole world? Of course, when I say one of them, I mean a big one of them. It'd have to be, yeah. Like, really big. It's funny, but I see what you mean. Makes sense, right? Makes sense, yeah. Thing is... What? I just... Hope it never goes plop. But this is the disc world, which has not only the turtle, but also the four giant elephants on which the wide, slowly turning wheel of the world revolves. People wonder how this works, since a terrestrial elephant would be unlikely to bear a revolving mode for any length of time without some serious friction burns. But you may as well ask why the axle of a planet doesn't squeak, or where love goes, or what sound yellow makes. There is the Circle Sea, approximately halfway between the hub and the rim. 
Around it are those countries which, according to history, constitute the civilized world, i.e., a world that can support historians. Ephib, Tussaut, Omnia, Clatch, and the sprawling city-state of Ankh-Morpork. This is a story that starts somewhere else, where a man is lying on a raft in a blue lagoon under a sunny sky. His head is resting on his arms. He is happy. In his case, a mental state so rare as to be almost unprecedented. He is whistling an amiable little tune and dangling his feet in the crystal clear water. They are pink feet with ten toes that look like little piggy wiggies. From the point of view of a shark skimming over the reef, they look like lunch, dinner and tea. It was, as always, a matter of protocol, of discretion, of careful etiquette, of, ultimately, alcohol, or at least the illusion of alcohol. Lord Vetinari, as supreme ruler of Ankh Morpork, could in theory summon the Arch-Chancellor of Unseen University to his presence, and indeed have him executed if he failed to obey. On the other hand, Mustrum Ridcully, as head of the College of Wizards, had made it clear in polite but firm ways that he could turn him into a small amphibian and indeed start jumping around the room on a pogo stick. Alcohol bridged the diplomatic gap nicely. Sometimes Lord Vetinari invited the Arch-Chancellor to the palace for a convivial drink, and of course the Arch-Chancellor went because it would be bad manners not to and everyone understood the position, and everyone was on their best behaviour, and thus civil unrest and slime on the carpet were adverted. It was a beautiful afternoon. Lord Vetinari was sitting in the palace gardens, watching the butterflies with an expression of mild annoyance. He found something very slightly offensive about the way they just fluttered around, enjoying themselves in an unprofitable way. He looked up. Ah, Arch-Chancellor, he said. So good to see you. Do sit down. I trust you are well. Yes, indeed, said Mustrum Ridcully. And, and yourself, you are in, in good health? Never better. The weather, I see, has turned out nice again. I thought yesterday was particularly fine, certainly. Tomorrow, I am told could well be even better. We could uh, certainly do with a fine spell. Yes, indeed. Yes. Ah, certainly. They watched the butterflies. A butler brought long, cool drinks. What is it they actually do with the flowers? said Lord Vetinari. What? The patrician shrugged. Never mind. It was not at all important. But since you are here, Arch-Chancellor, having dropped by on your way to something infinitely more important, I am sure most kind, I wonder if you could tell me who is the great wizard? Ridcully considered this. Uh... The dean, possibly, he said. He must be all of twenty stone. Somehow I feel that is not perhaps the right answer, said Lord Betinari. I suspect from context that great means superior. Ah, not the dean, then, said Ridcully. Lord Vetinari tried to recollect the faculty of Unseen University. The mental picture that emerged was of a small range of foothills in pointy hats. The context does not, I feel, suggest the dean, he said. Uh, what context would this be, said Ridcully. The patrician picked up his walking stick. Come this way, he said. I suppose you had better see for yourself. It is uh, very vexing. Ridcully looked around with interest as he followed Lord Vetinari. He did not often have the chance to see the gardens, which had been written up in the How Not to Do It section of gardening manuals everywhere. They had been laid out, and a truer phrase was never used, by the renowned or at least notorious landscape gardener and all-round inventor, Bloody Stupid Johnson, whose absent-mindedness and blindness to elementary mathematics made every step a walk with danger. His genius 
well, as far as Ridcully understood it, his genius was exactly the opposite of whatever kind of genius it was that built earthworks that tapped the secret yet beneficent forces of the ley lines. No one was quite certain what forces Bloody Stupid's designs tapped, but the chiming sundial frequently exploded, the crazy paving had committed suicide, and the cast-iron garden furniture was known to have melted on three occasions. The patrician led the way through a gate and into something like a dovecot. A creaking wooden stairway led around the inside. A few of Ankh Morpork's indestructible feral pigeons muttered and sniggered in the shadows. "'What's this?' said Ridcully, as the stairs groaned under him. The patrician took a key out of his pocket. "'I have always understood that Mr. Johnson originally planned this to be a beehive,' he said. "'However, in the absence of bees ten feet long, we have found other uses.' He unlocked a door to a wide square room with a big unglazed window in each wall. Each rectangle was surrounded by a wooden arrangement to which was affixed a bell on a spring. It was apparent that anything large enough entering by one of the windows would cause the bell to ring. In the centre of the room, standing on a table, was the largest bird Ridcully had ever seen. It turned and fixed him with a beady yellow eye. The patrician reached into a pocket and took out a jar of anchovies. This one caught us rather unexpectedly, he said. It must be almost ten years since a message last arrived. We used to keep a few fresh mackerel on ice. Isn't that a pointless albatross, said Ridcully. Indeed, said Lord Vetinari, and a highly trained one. It will return this evening... Six thousand miles on one jar of anchovies and a bottle of fish paste my clerk drum not found in the kitchens. Amazing. I, I'm sorry, said Ridcully. Uh, re re return to where? Lord Vetinari turned to face him. Not, let me make it clear, to the counterweight continent, he said. This is not one of those birds the Agatean Empire uses for its message service. It is a well-known fact that we have no contact with that mysterious land, and this bird is not the first to arrive here for many years, and it did not bring a strange and puzzling message. Do I make myself clear? Um, no. Good. This is not an albatross. The patrician smiled. Ah, I can see you're getting the hang of it. Mustrum Ridcully, though possessed of a large and efficient brain, was not at home with duplicity. He looked at the long, vicious beak. Looks like a bloody albatross to me, he said. And you just said it was. I said, isn't that a... The patrician waved a hand irritably. "'Leaving aside our ornithological studies,' he said, "'the point is that this bird had in its message pouch "'the following piece of paper.' "'You mean uh, did not have the following piece of paper?' "'said Ridcully, struggling for a grip. "'Ah, yes, yes, of course, that is what I mean, "'and this isn't it. Observe.' He handed a single small sheet to the Arch-Chancellor. "'Looks like a, a painting,' said Ridcully. "'Those are Agatean pictograms,' said the patrician. "'You mean they're, they're not Agatean pictograms?' "'Yes, yes, certainly,' sighed the patrician. "'I can see you are well alongside the essential business of diplomacy. "'Now, your views, please.' Looks like, um, slosh, 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 wizard, said Ridcully. And from that you deduce? He took art because he wasn't any good at spelling? I mean, who wrote it, painted it, I mean? I don't know. The Grand Viziers used to send the occasional message, but I gather there has been some turmoil in recent years... It is unsigned, you notice. However, I cannot ignore it. 
Wizard. Uh, wizard, said Ridcully thoughtfully. The pictograms mean, send us instantly the great, said Lord Vetinari. Wizard, said Ridcully to himself, tapping the paper. The patrician tossed an anchovy to the albatross, which swallowed it greedily. The Empire has a million men under arms, he said. Happily, it suits the rulers to pretend that everywhere outside the Empire is a valueless howling waste, peopled only by vampires and ghosts. They usually have no interest whatsoever in our affairs. This is fortunate for us because they are both cunning, rich, and powerful. Frankly, I had hoped they had forgotten about us altogether. And now this. I was hoping to be able to dispatch the wretched person and forget about it. Wizard, said Ridcully. Perhaps you would like a holiday, said the patrician, a hint of hope in his voice. Me? Oh, uh, no, uh, can't abide foreign food, said Ridcully quickly. He repeated half to himself. Wizard. The word seems to fascinate you, said Lord Vetinari. Seen it spelled like that before, said Ridcully. Can't remember where. I'm sure you will remember, and will be in a position to send the great wizard, however he is spelled, to the Empire by tea time. Ridcully's jaw dropped. Uh, six thousand miles? By, by magic? Do you know how, how, how hard that is? I cherish my ignorance on the subject, said Lord Vetinari. Besides, Ridcully went on, they're, well, they, they, they're foreign over there. I thought they had enough wizards of their own. I really couldn't say. We don't know why they want this wizard? No, but I'm sure there is someone you could spare. There seems to be such a lot of you down there. I mean, it could be for some terrible foreign purpose, said Ridcully. For some reason, the face of the dean waddled across his mind, and he brightened up. They might be happy with a great wizard, do you think? he mused. I leave that entirely to you. But by tonight, I would like to be able to send back a message saying that the great wizard is duly on his way, and then we can forget about it. Of course, it would be very hard to um, bring the chap back, said Ridcully. He thought of the dean again. Practically impossible, he added, in an inappropriately happy way. I expect we'd try for months and months without succeeding. I expect we'd attempt everything with no luck. Damn it. I can see you are agog to rise to this challenge, said the patrician. Let me not detain you from rushing back to the university and putting measures in hand. But wizard, Ridcully murmured. Rings a faint bell, that. Think I've, I've seen it before somewhere. The shark didn't think much. Sharks don't. Their thought processes can largely be represented by equals. You see it, equals, you eat it. But as it arrowed through the waters of the lagoon, its tiny brain began to receive little packages of salation existential dread that could only be called doubts. It knew it was the biggest shark around. All the challengers had fled, or run up against the good old equals. Yet its body told it that something was coming up fast behind it. It turned gracefully, and the first thing it saw was hundreds of legs and thousands of toes, a whole pork pie factory of piggy-wiggies. Many things went on at Unseen University, and regrettably teaching had to be one of them. The faculty had long ago confronted this fact, and had perfected various devices for avoiding it. 
but this was perfectly all right because, to be fair, so had the students. The system worked quite well, and as happens in such cases, had taken on the status of a tradition. Lectures clearly took place because they were down there on the timetable in black and white. The fact that no one attended was an irrelevant detail. It was occasionally maintained that this meant that the lectures did not, in fact, happen at all, but no one ever attended them to find out if this was true. Anyway, it was argued by the reader in woolly thinking, which is like fuzzy logic, only less so, that lectures had taken place in essence. So that was all right too. And therefore, education at the university mostly worked by the age-old method of putting a lot of young people in the vicinity of a lot of books and hoping that something would pass from one to the other, while the actual young people put themselves in the vicinity of inns and taverns for exactly the same reason. It was the middle of the afternoon. The chair of indefinite studies was giving a lecture in room 3B, and therefore his presence asleep in front of the fire in the uncommon room was a technicality upon which no diplomatic man would comment. Ridcully kicked him on the shins. Ow! Sorry to interrupt, uh, chair, said Ridcully in a very perfunctory way. God's help me, I need the council of wizards. Mm, where is everybody? The chair of indefinite studies rubbed his legs. I know the lecturer in recent rooms is giving a lecture in 3B, he said. But I don't know where he is. You know, that really hurt. All virtual lectures took place in room 3B, a room not locatable on any floor plan of the university, and also it was considered infinite in size. Round everyone up. My study. Ten minutes, said Ridcully. He was a great believer in this approach. A less direct arch-chancellor would have wandered around looking for everyone. His policy was to find one person and make their life difficult until everything happened the way he wanted it to, a policy adopted by almost all managers and several notable gods. Nothing in nature had that many feet. True, some things had that many legs, damp, wriggling things that live under rocks, but those weren't legs with feet, they were just legs that ended without ceremony. Something brighter than the shark might have been wary, but... Equals swung treacherously into play and shot it forward. That was its first mistake. In these circumstances, one mistake equals oblivion. Ridcully was waiting impatiently when, one by one, the senior wizards filed in from serious lecturing in room 3B. Senior wizards needed a lot of lecturing in order to digest their food. Everyone here, he said. Right, sit down. Um, l listen carefully. Now, Vetinari hasn't had an albatross. I it hasn't come all the way from the counterweight continent, and there isn't a strange message that we've got to obey, apparently. Follow me so far? The senior wizards exchanged glances. I think we may be a shade unclear on the detail, said the dean. I was using uh, diplomatic language. Could you perhaps try to be a little more indiscreet? We've got to send a wizard to the counterweight continent, said Ridcully, and we've got to do it by tea time. Someone's asked for a great wizard, and it seems we've got to send one. Only they spell it W-I-Z-Z-A-R-D. Who? Yes, librarian? Unseen university's librarian, who had been dozing with his head on the table, was suddenly sitting bolt upright. Then he pushed back his chair, and arms waving wildly for balance, left the room at a bow-legged run. Probably remembered an overdue book, said the dean. He lowered his voice. Am I alone in thinking, by the way, that it doesn't add to the status of this university to have an ape on the faculty? Yes, said Ridcully, flatly. You are. We've got the only librarian who can rip off your arm with his leg. People respect that. Only the other day, the head of the Thieves' Guild was asking me if we could turn their librarian into an ape. Besides, he is the only one of you buggers who stays awake more than an hour a day. Anyway, well, I find it embarrassing, said the dean. Also, he's not a proper orangutan. I've been reading a book. It says a dominant male should have huge cheek pads. Has he got huge cheek pads? 
I don't think so. And shut up, Dean, said Ridcully, or I won't let you go to the counterweight continent. I don't see what raising a perfectly val... What? They're asking for the great wizard, said Ridcully, and I immediately thought of you. As the only man I know who can sit on two chairs at the same time, he added silently. The Empire, squeaked the Dean. Me? But they hate foreigners. So do you. You should get on famously. It's six thousand miles, said the Dean, trying a new tack. Everyone knows you can't get that far by magic. Ah,、uh, as a matter of fact, you can, I think, said a voice from the other end of the table. They all looked at Ponder Stibbons, the youngest and most depressingly keen member of the faculty. He was holding a complicated mechanism of sliding wooden bars and peering at the other wizards over the top of it.、Uh, shouldn't be too much of a problem, he added. People used to think it was, but I'm pretty sure it's all a matter of energy absorption and attention to relative velocities. The statement was followed with the kind of mystified and suspicious silence that generally succeeded one of his remarks.、Uh, relative velocities. Said Ridcully. Yes, Arch Chancellor. Ponder looked down at his prototype slide rule and waited. He knew that Ridcully would feel it necessary to add a comment at this point in order to demonstrate that he'd grasped something. My mother could move like lightning when, I mean, how fast things are going when compared to other things. Ponder said quickly, but not quite quickly enough. We should be able to work it out quite easily. Ah,、uh, on. Hex. Oh no," said the lecturer in recent runes, pushing his chair back. "Not that. That's meddling with things you don't understand." "Well, we are wizards," said Red Cully. "We're supposed to meddle with things we don't understand. If we hung around waiting till we understood things, we'd we'd never get anything done." "Look, I don't mind summoning some demon and asking it." Said the lecturer in recent runes, "That's normal, but building some mechanical contrivance to do your thinking for you—that's that's against nature. Besides," he added in slightly less foreboding tones, "last time you did a big problem on it, the wretched thing broke, and we had ants all over the place." We've sorted that out," said Ponder. "We." I must admit there was a ram's skull in the middle of it last time I looked," said Ridcully. "We had to add that to do occult transformations," said Ponder. "But and 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 cogwheels and springs," the Arch Chancellor went on. "Well, the ants aren't very good at differential analysis. So and that strange wobbly thing with the cuckoo." The unreal time clock," said Ponder. "Yes, we think that's essential for working out. Anyway, it's all quite immaterial because I certainly have no intention of going anywhere," said the dean. "Send a student if you must. We've got a lot of spare ones. Good so be, would you, if Duff Plum of Helping Second A," said the bursar. The table fell silent. Anyone understand that? said Ridcully. The bursar was not technically insane. He had passed through the rapids of insanity some time previously, and was now sculling around in some peaceful pool on the other side. He was often quite coherent, although not by normal human standards. Ah,、uh, he's going through yesterday again," said the senior wrangler.、Uh, "Backwards this time." We should send the bursar," said the dean firmly. You certainly not. You probably can't get dried frog pills there. <gasps> the librarian re-entered the study at a bandy-legged run, waving something in the air. It was red, or at least had some time been red. It might well once have been a pointy hat, but the point had crumpled and most of the brim was burned away. A word had been embroidered on it in sequins. Many had been burned off, but wizard. Could just be made out as pale letters on a scorched cloth. 
I knew I'd seen it before, said Ridcully, on a shelf in the library, right? <laughs> the Arch-Chancellor inspected the remnant. Wizard, he said. What kind of sad, hopeless person needs to write wizard on their hat? A few bubbles broke the surface of the sea, causing the raft to rock a little. After a while, a couple of pieces of shark skin floated up. Rincewind sighed and put down his fishing rod. The rest of the shark would be dragged ashore later, he knew it. He couldn't imagine why. It wasn't as if they were good eating. They tasted like old boots soaked in urine. He picked up a makeshift oar and set out for the beach. It wasn't a bad little island. Storms seemed to pass it by. So did ships. But there were coconuts and breadfruit and some sort of wild fig. Even his experiments in alcohol had been quite successful, although he hadn't been able to walk properly for two days. The lagoon provided prawns and shrimps and oysters and crabs and lobsters, and in the deep green water out beyond the reef, big silver fish fought each other for the privilege of biting a piece of bent wire on the end of a bit of string. After six months on the island, in fact, there was only one thing Rincewind lacked. He'd never really thought about it before. Now he thought about it. Or more correctly, them. All the time. It was odd. He'd hardly ever thought about them in Ankhmore Pork, because they were there if he ever wanted them. Now they weren't, and he craved. His raft bumped the white sand at about the same moment as a large canoe rounded the reef and entered the lagoon. Ridcully was sitting at his desk now, surrounded by his senior wizards. They were trying to tell him things, despite the known danger of trying to tell Ridcully things, which was that he picked up the facts he liked and let the others take a running jump. Uh, so, he said, not a kind of cheese. No, Arch-Chancellor, said the Chair of Indefinite Studies. Rincewind is a kind of wizard. Was, said the lecturer in recent runes. Not a cheese, said Ridcully, unwilling to let go of a fact. No. Sounds the sort of name you'd associate with cheese. I mean, a pound of mature Rincewind. It rolls off the tongue. God's damn it, Rincewind is not a cheese, shouted the dean, his temper briefly cracking. Rincewind is not a yoghurt or any kind of sour milk derivative. Rincewind is a bloody nuisance, a complete and utter disgrace to wizardry, a fool, a failure. Anyway, he hasn't been seen here since that unpleasantness with the sorcerer years ago. Really, said Ridcully, with a certain kind of nasty politeness. A lot of wizards behaved very badly then, I understand. Yes, indeed, said the lecturer in recent runes, scowling at the dean who bridled. I don't know anything about that, runes. I wasn't dean at the time. No, but you were very senior. Perhaps, but it just so happens that at the time I was visiting my aunt, for your information. They nearly blew up the whole city. She lives in Quirm, and Quirm was heavily involved, as I recall. Near Quirm, near Quirm, not all that near, actually, quite a way along the coast. <laughs> anyway, you seem to be very well informed, eh, runes, said the dean. I, well, I, I was studying hard at the time, hardly knew what was going on. Half the university was blown down, the dean remembered himself, and added, uh, That is, so I heard, uh, later, after getting back from my aunt's. Yes, but I've got a very thick door, and I happen to know the senior wrangler was here, because with that heavy green baize stuff you could hardly hear any nap for time it think I, said the bursar. Will you all shut up right now this minute? Ridcully glared at his faculty with the clear, innocent glare of someone who was blessed at birth with no imagination whatsoever, and who had genuinely been hundreds of miles away during the university's recently embarrassing history. Right, he said, when they'd quietened down. This uh, rincewind. Bit of an idiot, yes? You talk, Dean. 
Everyone else will shut up. The dean looked uncertain. Well, uh, I mean, it makes no sense, Archchancellor. He couldn't even do proper magic. What good would he be to anyone? Besides, where Rincewind went, he lowered his voice. Trouble followed behind. Rid Cully noticed that the wizards drew a little closer together. Sounds all right to me, he said. Best place for trouble, behind. You certainly don't want it in front. You don't understand, Arch-Chancellor, said the Dean. It followed behind on hundreds of little legs. The Arch-Chancellor's smile stayed where it was while the rest of his face went solid behind it. You, um, been on the bursar's pills, Dean? I assure you, Mustrum. Then don't talk rubbish. Very well, Arch-Chancellor, but you do realize, don't you, that it might take years to find him? Um, said Ponder, if we can work out his thaumic signature, I think Hex could probably do it in a day. The dean glared. That's not magic, he snapped. That's just engineering. Rincewind trudged through the shallows and used a sharp rock to hack the top of a coconut that had been cooling in a convenient shady rock pool. He put it to his lips. A shadow fell across him. It said, Uh, hello? It was possible, if you kept on talking at the Arch-Chancellor for long enough, that some facts might squeeze through. So, uh, what you're telling me, said Ridcully eventually, is that this Rincewind fella has been chased by just about every army in the world, has been bounced around like a pea on a drum, and probably is the one wizard who knows anything about the Agatean Empire on account of once being friends with... He glanced at his notes. A strange little man in glasses who came from there and gave him this funny thing with the legs you all keep alluding to. And he can speak the lingo. Am I right so far? Exactly, Arch-Chancellor. Call me an idiot if you like, said the Dean, but why would anyone want him? Rid Cully looked down at his notes again. You've decided to go, then? No, of course not. What I don't think you've, um, spotted here, Dean, he said, breaking into a determinedly cheery grin, is what I might call the common denominator. Chap stays alive, talented. Find him, and bring him here, wherever he is. Poor chap could be facing something dreadful. The coconut stayed where it was, but Rincewind's eyes swiveled madly from side to side. Three figures stepped into his line of vision. They were obviously female. They were um, abundantly female. They were not wearing a great deal of clothing and seemed to be altogether too fresh from the hairdressers for people who had just been paddling a large war canoe. But this is often the case with beautiful Amazonian warriors. A thin trickle of coconut milk began to dribble off the end of Rincewind's beard. The leading woman brushed aside her long blonde hair and gave him a bright smile. I know this sounds a little unlikely, she said, but I and my sisters here represent a hitherto undiscovered tribe whose men folk were recently destroyed in a deadly but short-lived and highly specific plague. Now we have been searching these islands for a man to enable us to carry on our line. How much do you think he weighs? Rincewind's eyebrows raised. The woman looked down shyly. You may be wondering why we are all blonde and white-skinned when everyone else in the islands around here is dark, she said. It just seems to be one of those genetic things. About 120, 125 pounds. Put another pound or two of junk on the heap. Uh, can you detect, you know, it? This is all going to go wrong, Mr. Stibbons. I just know it. He's only 600 miles away, and we know where we are, and he's on the right half of the disc. Anyway, I've worked this out on Hex, so nothing can possibly go wrong. Yes, but can anyone see that, you know, with the feet? 
Rincewind's eyebrows waggled. A sort of choking noise came from his throat. Can't see it. Will you lot stop huffing on my crystal ball? And of course, if you were to come with us, we could promise you earthly and sensual pleasures, such as those of which you may have dreamed. All right, on the count of three. The coconut dropped away. Rincewind swallowed. There was a hungry, dreamy look in his eyes. Can I have them mashed? He said. Now. First, there was a sensation of pressure. The world opened up in front of Rincewind and sucked him into it. Then it stretched out thin and went twang. Cloud rushed past him, blurred by speed. When he dared open his eyes again, it was to see far ahead of him a tiny black dot. It got bigger. It resolved itself into a tight cloud of objects. There were a couple of heavy saucepans, a large brass candlestick, a few bricks, a chair, and a large brass blamange mould in the shape of a castle. They hit him one after the other. The blamange mould making a humorous clang as it bounced off his head, and then whirled away behind him. The next thing ahead of him was an octagon, a chalked one. He hit it. Ridcully stared down. Uh, a shade less than a hundred and twenty-five pounds, I fancy," he said. "All the same, well done, gentlemen." The dishevelled scarecrow in the centre of the circle staggered to its feet and beat out one or two small fires in its clothing. Then it looked around blearily and said, eh. "He could be a little uh, disorientated." The Arch Chancellor went on, "More than six hundred miles in two seconds, after all." Don't give him a nasty shock. Like sleepwalkers, you mean? Said the senior wrangler.、Uh, what do you mean, sleepwalkers? If you wake sleepwalkers, their legs drop off. So my grandmother used to aver. And we are sure it's Rincewind," said the dean. Of course it's Rincewind," said the senior wrangler. We spent hours looking for him. It could be some dangerous occult creature," said the dean stubbornly. With that hat, it was a pointy hat, in a way, a kind of cargo cult pointy hat made out of a split bamboo and coconut leaves, in the hope of attracting passing wizardliness. Picked out on it in seashells, held in place with grass, was the word wizard. Its wearer gazed right through the wizards, and, as if driven by some sudden recollection of purpose, lurched abruptly out of the octagon and headed towards the door of the hall. The wizards followed cautiously. I am not sure I believe her. How many times did she see it happen? I don't know. She never said. The bursar sleepwalks most nights, you know. Does he? Tempting. Rincewind, if that was the creature's name, headed out into Sator Square. It was crowded. The air shimmered over the braziers of chestnut sellers and hot potato merchants, and echoed with the traditional street cries of old Ark Morpork, such as "Ouch, Ark, give me back my money, you scoundrel!" and "You call these chestnuts? I call them little balls of charcoal. That's what I call them." The figure sidled up to a skinny man in a huge overcoat who was frying something over a little oil heater in a wide tray around his neck. The possibly rincewind grabbed the edge of the tray. "Got any potatoes?" it growled. "Potatoes? No, squire. Got some sausages in a bun." The possibly rincewind froze, and then it burst into tears. Sausage in a bun," it bawled. "Dear old sausage in a, in in a bun. Give me sausage in a bun." It grabbed three off the tray and tried to eat them all at once. "Good grief," said Ridcully. The figure half ran, half capered away. Fragments of bun and pork product debris cascading from its unkempt beard. I've never seen anyone eat three of Throat Dibbler's sausage in a bun and look so happy," said the senior wrangler. "I've never seen someone eat three of Throat Dibbler's sausages in a bun and look so upright," said the dean. "I've never seen anyone eat anything of Dibbler's and get away without paying," said the lecturer in recent rooms. 
The figure spun happily around the square, tears streaming down its face. The gyrations took it past an alley mouth, whereupon a smaller figure stepped out behind it, and with some difficulty hit it on the back of the head. The sausage-eater fell to his knees, saying to the world in general, Ow! No, 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 no! A rather older man stepped out and removed the cosh from the young man's hesitant hands, while the victim knelt and moaned. I think you ought to apologize to the poor gentleman, said the older man. I don't know what's he gonna think. I mean, look at him. He made it so easy for you, and what does he get? I mean, what did you think you were doing? Mumble, 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 Mr. Boggis, said the boy, looking at his feet. What was that again? Speak up. Overarm belter, Mr. Boggis. That was an overarm belter? You call that an overarm belter? That was an overarm belter, was it? This, excuse me, sir, we'll just have you up on your feet for a moment. Sorry about this. This is an overarm belter. Ow, shouted the victim, and then to the surprise of all concerned, he added, <laughs> What you did was, sorry to impose again, sir, this won't take a minute, what you did was this. Ow! <laughs> Now, you lot, you saw that. Come on, gather round. Half a dozen other youths slouched out of the alleyways and formed a ragged audience around Mr. Boggis. The luckless student and the victim, who were staggering in a circle and making little moo, moo sounds, but still, for some reason, apparently enjoying himself immensely. Now, said Mr. Boggis, with the air of an old skilled craftsman imparting his professional expertise to an ungrateful posterity. When inconveniencing a customer from your basic alley entrance, the correct procedure is... Oh, hello, Mr. Rudcully. Didn't see you there. The Arch-Chancellor gave him a friendly nod. Uh, don't mind us, Mr. Boggis. Thieves' Guild training, is it? Boggis rolled his eyes. Don't know what they teach us about school, he said. It's just nothing but reading and writing all the time. When I was a lad, school was where you learned something useful. Right, you, Wilkins, stop that giggling. You have a go. Excuse us just one other moment, sir. Ow! Oh. No, 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 no. My old granny could do better than that. Now, look. You steps up trimly, places one hand on his shoulder here for control. Go on, you do it. And then smartly... Ow! All right, can anyone tell me what he was doing wrong? The figure crawled away unnoticed, except by the wizards, while Mr. Boggis was demonstrating the finer points of head percussion on Wilkins. It staggered to his feet and plunged along the road, still moving like one hypnotized. He's crying, said the dean. Not surprising, said the arch-chancellor, but why is he grinning at the same time? Curiouser and curiouser, said the senior wrangler. Bruised and possibly poisoned, the figure headed back for the university, the wizard still trailing behind. You must mean curious and more curious, surely. And even then it doesn't make much sense. It entered the gates, but this time hurried jerkily through the main hall and into the library. The librarian was waiting, holding, with something of a smirk on his face, and an orangutan can really smirk, the battered hat. Amazing, said Ridcully. It, it's true. A wizard will always come back for his hat. The figure grabbed the hat, evicted some spiders, threw away the sad affair made of leaves, and put the hat on his head. Rincewind blinked at the puzzled faculty. A light came on behind his eyes for the first time, as if up to now he'd merely been operating by reflex reaction. Er, uh, what have I just eaten? Um, three of Mr. Dibbler's finest uh, sausages, said Ridcully. Well, when I say finest, I mean most typical, don't you know? I see. And who just hit me? Thieves' Guild apprentices out training. Rincewind blinked. This is Ankh Morpork, isn't it? Yes. I thought so. Rincewind blinked slowly. Well he said, just as he fell forward. I'm back. Lord Hong was flying a kite. It was something he did perfectly. 
Lord Hong did everything perfectly. His watercolours were perfect, his poetry was perfect. When he folded paper, every crease was perfect. Imaginative, original, and definitely perfect. Lord Hong had long ago ceased pursuing perfection because he already had it nailed up in a dungeon somewhere. Lord Hong was twenty-six and thin and handsome. He wore very small, very circular, steel-rimmed spectacles. When asked to describe him, people often used the word smooth or even lacquered. And often the phrase, a bastard you don't want to cross, and I didn't say that. And he had risen to the leadership of one of the most influential families in the empire by relentless application, total focusing of his mental powers, and six well-executed deaths. The last one had been that of his father, who died happy in the knowledge that his son was maintaining an old family tradition. The senior families venerated their ancestors and saw no harm in prematurely adding to their number. And now his kite, the black kite with the two big eyes, plunged out of the sky. He'd calculated the angle, needless to say, perfectly. Its string, coated with glue and ground glass, soared through those of his fellow contestants and sent their kites tumbling. There was genteel applause from the bystanders. People generally found it advisable to applaud Lord Hong. He handed the string to a servant, nodded curtly at the fellow flyers, and strode towards his tent. Once inside, he sat down and looked at his visitor. Well, he said, we sent the message, said the visitor. No one saw us. On the contrary, said Lord Hong, twenty people saw you. Do you know how hard it is for a guard to look straight ahead and see nothing when people are creeping around, making a noise like an army and whispering to one another to be quiet? Frankly, your people do not seem to possess that revolutionary spark. What is the matter with your hand? The albatross bit it. Lord Hong smiled. It occurred to him that it might have mistaken his visitor for an anchovy, and with some justification. There was the same fishy look about the eyes. I don't understand, oh Lord, said the visitor, whose name was Two Fire Herb. Good. But they believe in the great wizard, and you want him to come here? Oh, certainly. I have my... People in, he tried the alien syllables, Ankh more pork. The one so foolishly called the Great Wizard does exist, but I might tell you he is renowned for being incompetent, cowardly, and spineless. Quite proverbially so. So I think the Red Army should have their leader, don't you? It will raise their morale. He smiled again. This is politics, he said. Ah, now go. Lord Hong picked up a book as his visitor left, but it was hardly a real book. Pieces of paper had simply been fastened together with string, and the text was handwritten. He'd read it many times before. It still amused him, mainly because the author had managed to be wrong about so many things. Now, every time he finished a page, he ripped it out and while reading the next page, carefully folded the paper into the shape of a chrysanthemum. Great wizard, he said aloud. Oh, indeed, very great. Rincewind awoke. There were clean sheets, and no one was saying, go through his pockets. So he chalked that up as a promising beginning. He kept his eyes shut, just in case there was anyone around who, once he was seen to be awake, would make life complicated for him. Elderly male voices were arguing. You're all missing the point. He survives. You keep on telling me he's had all these adventures and he's still alive. What do you mean? He's got scars all over him. My point exactly, Dean. Most of them on his back, too. He leaves trouble behind. Someone up there smiles on him. Rincewind winced. He had always been aware that someone up there was doing something on him. He'd never considered it was smiling. He's not even a proper wizard. He never got more than two percent in his exams. I think he's awake, said someone. 
Rincewind gave in and opened his eyes. A variety of bearded, overly pink faces looked down on him. How are you feeling, old chap? said one, extending a hand. Name's Ridcully, Arch Chancellor. How are you feeling? It's all going to go wrong, said Rincewind flatly. Um, what do you mean, old fellow? I just know it. It's all going to go wrong. Something dreadful is going to happen. I thought it was too good to last. You see, said the dean, hundreds of little legs. I told you. Would you listen? Rincewind sat up. Don't start being nice to me, he said. Don't start offering me grapes. No one ever wants me for something nice. A confused memory of his very recent past floated across his mind, and he experienced a brief moment of regret that potatoes, while uppermost in his mind at that point, had not been similarly positioned in the mind of the young lady. No one dressed like that, he was coming to realise, could be thinking of any kind of root vegetable. He sighed. All right. What happens now? How do you feel? Rincewind shook his head. It's no good, he said. I hate it when people are nice to me. It means something bad is going to happen. Do you mind shouting? Ridcully had had enough. Get out of that bed, you horrible little man, and follow me this minute, or it will go very hard for you. Ah, that's better. I feel right at home now. Now we're cooking with charcoal, said Rincewind glumly. He swung his legs off the bed and stood up carefully. Ridcully stopped halfway to the door where the other wizards had lined up. Runes? Yes, Arch-Chancellor, said the lecturer in recent runes, his voice oozing innocence. What is that you've um, got behind your back? Sorry, Arch-Chancellor, said the lecturer in recent runes. Looks like some kind of tool, said Ridcully. Oh, this, said the lecturer in recent runes, as if he'd only just at that moment noticed the eight-pound lump hammer he'd been holding. My word, it's, it's a hammer, isn't it? My word, a hammer. I suppose I must have but picked it up somewhere, you know, to keep the place tidy. And I can't help noticing, said Ridcully, that the dean seems to be trying to conceal a battle axe about his person. There was a musical twang from the rear of the chair of indefinite studies. And that sounded like a saw to me, said Ridcully. Is there anyone here not concealing some kind of implement? Right. Would anyone care to explain what the hell you think you're doing? <laughs> you don't know what it was like, muttered the dean, not meeting the arch-chancellor's eye. A man daren't turn his back for five minutes in those days. You'd hear the patter of those damn feet, and Ridcully ignored him. He put an arm round Rincewind's bony shoulders and led the way towards the great hall. Well now, Rincewind, he said, they tell me you're no good at magic. That's right. Never passed any exams or anything? None, I'm afraid. But everyone calls you Rincewind the Wizard. Rincewind looked at his feet. Well, I kind of worked here as a sort of deputy librarian. An apes number two, said the dean, and, you know, did odd jobs and things and kind of, you know, helped out. I say, did anyone notice that? An apes number two? Rather clever, I thought. But you have never, in fact, actually been entitled to call yourself a wizard, said Ridcully. Not technically, I suppose. I see. Hmm, that is a problem. I've got this hat with the word wizard on it, said Rincewind, hopefully. Not a great help, I'm afraid. Hmm, this presents us with a bit of a difficulty, I'm afraid. Let me see. How long can you hold your breath? I don't know. A couple of minutes. Is that important? It is in the context of being nailed upside down to one of the supports of the brass bridge for two high tides and then being beheaded, which I'm afraid is the statutory punishment for impersonating a wizard. I looked it up. No one was more sorry than me, I can tell you. But the law is the law. Oh, no. Sorry, no alternative. Otherwise we'd be knee-deep in people in pointy hats they'd no right to. It's a terrible shame. 
Can't do a thing. Wish I could. Hands tied. The statutes say you can only be a wizard by passing through the university in the in the normal way, or by performing some great service of benefit to magic. And I'm afraid that. Couldn't you just send me back to my island? I liked it there. It was dull. Rid Cully shook his head sadly. No can do, I'm afraid. The offence has been committed over a period of many years, and since you haven't passed any exams or performed, Rid Cully raised his voice slightly. Any service of great benefit to magic, I am afraid I shall have to instruct the Bledlows to fetch some rope, and Bledlows, the UU College Porters, renowned among the entire faculty for the hardness of their skulls, their obtuseness in the face of reasonable explanation, and their deeply held conviction that the whole place would collapse without them. Er,、uh, I think I may have saved the world a couple of times," said Rincewind. Does that help? Did anyone from the university see you do it? No, I don't think so. Rid Cully shook his head. Probably doesn't count then. It's a shame because if you had performed any service of great benefit to magic, then I'd be happy to let you keep that hat and, of course, something to wear it on. Rincewind looked crestfallen. Rid Cully sighed and had one last try. So he said, "Since it seems that you haven't actually passed your exams or performed a service of great benefit to magic, well, I suppose I could try to perform some great service," said Rincewind, with the expression of one who knows that the light at the end of the tunnel is an oncoming train. Really? Oh, hmm. Well, oof. Hmm. Well, that's definitely a thought," said Rid Cully. "What sort of services are they? Oh, typically you'd be expected to, for the sake of example, go on a quest, or find the answer to some very ancient and important question. What the hell is that thing with all the legs?" Rincewind didn't even bother to look around. The expression on Rid Cully's face, as it stared over his shoulder, was quite familiar. Ah," he said. "I think I know that one. Magic isn't like maths. Like the disc world itself, it follows common sense rather than logic. And nor is it like cookery. A cake's a cake. Mix the ingredients upright and cook them in the right temperature, and a cake happens. No casserole requires moonbeams. No souffle ever demanded to be mixed by a virgin." Nevertheless, those afflicted with an inquiring turn of mind have often wondered whether there are rules of magic. There are more than five hundred known spells to secure the love of another person, and they range from messing around with fern seed at midnight to doing something rather unpleasant with a rhino horn at an unspecified time, but probably not just after a meal. Was it possible? The inquiring minds inquired that an analysis of all these spells might reveal some small, powerful common denominator, some. Meta spell, some simple little equation which would achieve the required end far more simply, and incidentally come as a great relief to all rhinos. To answer such questions, hex had been built, although Ponder Stibbons was a bit uneasy about the word "built" in this context. He and a few keen students had put it together, certainly, but well, sometimes he thought bits of it, strange though this sounded, just turned up. For example, he was pretty sure no one had designed the phase of the moon generator, but there it was, clearly a part of the whole thing. They had built the unreal time clock, although no one seemed to have a very clear idea how it worked. What he suspected they were dealing with was a specialised case of formative causation, always a risk in a place like Unseen University, where reality was stretched so thin and therefore blown by so many strange breezes. If that was so, then they weren't exactly designing something. They were just putting physical clothes on an idea that was already there—a shadow of something that had been waiting to exist. He'd explained at length to the faculty that Hex didn't think. It was obvious that it couldn't think. Part of it was clockwork. A lot of it was a giant ant farm. The interface where the ants rode up and down on a little paternoster that turned a significant cogwheel was a little masterpiece. He thought. 
and the intricately controlled rushing of the ants through their maze of glass tubing was the most important part of the whole thing. But a lot of it had just accumulated, like the aquarium and wind chimes, which now seemed to be essential. A mouse had built a nest in the middle of it all, and had been allowed to become a fixture since the thing stopped working when they took it out. Nothing in that assemblage could possibly think, except in fairly limited ways about cheese or sugar. Nevertheless, in the middle of the night, when Hex was working hard, and the tubes rustled with the toiling ants, and things suddenly went clonk for no obvious reason, and the aquarium had been lowered on its davits so that the operator would have something to watch during the long hours, nevertheless, then a man might begin to speculate about what a brain was, and what thought was, and whether things that weren't alive could think, and whether a brain was just a more complicated version of hex. Or, around 4 a.m., when bits of the clockwork reversed direction suddenly and the mice squeaked, a less complicated version of hex. And wonder if the whole produced something not apparently inherent in the parts. In short, Ponder was just a little bit worried. He sat down at the keyboard. It was almost as big as the rest of Hex, to allow for the necessary levers and armatures. The various keys allowed little boards with holes in them to drop briefly into slots, forcing the ants into new paths. It took him some time to compose the problem, but at last he braced one foot on the structure and tugged on the enter lever. The ants scurried on new paths. The clockwork started to move. A small mechanism which Ponder would be prepared to swear had not been there yesterday, but which looked like a device for measuring wind speed, began to spin. After several minutes, a number of blocks with occult symbols on them dropped into the output hopper. Thank you, said Ponder, and then felt extremely silly for saying so. There was a tension to the thing, a feeling of mute straining and striving towards some distant and incomprehensible goal. As a wizard, it was something that Ponder had only before encountered in Acorns, a tiny, soundless voice which said, Yes, I am but a small, green, simple object, but I dream about forests. Only the other day, Adrian Turnipseed had typed in Y to see what happened. Some of the students had forecast that Hex would go mad trying to work it out. Ponder had expected Hex to produce the message, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark which it did with depressing frequency. Instead, after some unusual activity among the ants, it had laboriously produced because. With everyone else watching from behind a hastily overturned desk, Turnipseed had volunteered, Why anything? The reply had finally turned up, Because everything. Question mark, question mark, question mark, eternal domain, error, plus, 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 redo from start. Plus, plus, plus. No one knew who Redo from Start was, or why he was sending messages. But there were no more funny questions. No one wanted to risk getting answers. It was shortly afterwards that the thing like a broken umbrella with herrings on it appeared just behind the thing like a beach ball that went pop every fourteen minutes. Of course, books of magic developed a certain personality, derived from all that power in their pages. That's why it was unwise to go into the library without a stick. And now Ponder had helped build an engine for studying magic. Wizards had always known that the act of observation changed the thing that was observed, and sometimes forgot that it also changed the observer too. He was just beginning to suspect that Hex was redesigning itself. And he just said, thank you, to a thing that looked like it had been made by a glassblower with hiccups. He looked at the spell it had produced, hastily wrote it down and hurried out. Hex clicked to itself in the now empty room. The thing that went parp went parp. The unreal time clock ticked sideways. There was a rattle in the output slot. Don't mention it, plus plus, question mark, question mark, plus plus. Out of cheese, error. Redo from start. It was five minutes later. Fascinating, said Ridcully. Sapient pear wood, eh? He knelt down in an effort to see underneath. The luggage backed away. It was used to terror, horror, fear, and panic. It had seldom encountered interest before. 
The Arch-Chancellor stood up and brushed himself off. Ah, he said, as a dwarfish figure approached. Here's the gardener with the stepladder, the dean's in the chandelier, Modo. I'm quite happy up here, I assure you, said a voice from the ceiling regions. Perhaps someone would be kind enough to pass me up my tea. And I, I was amazed the senior wrangler could ever fit into the sideboard, said Ridcully. It's amazing how a man can, can fold himself up. I was just, uh, uh, just inspecting the silverware, said a voice from the depths of a drawer. The luggage opened its lid. Several wizards jumped back hurriedly. Ridcully examined the shark teeth stuck here and there in the woodwork. Kills sharks, you say, he said. Oh, yes, said Rincewind. Sometimes it drags them ashore and jumps up and down on them. Ridcully was impressed. Sapient pearwood was very rare in the countries between the ram tops and the Circle Sea. There were probably no living trees left. A few wizards were lucky enough to have inherited staffs made out of it. Economy of emotion was one of Ridcully's strong points. He had been impressed. He had been fascinated. He'd even, when the thing had landed in the middle of the wizards and caused the dean's remarkable feat of vertical acceleration, been slightly aghast. But he hadn't been frightened because he didn't have the imagination. My goodness, said a wizard. The arch-chancellor looked up. Yes, Bursa? It's this book the dean loaned me, Mustrum. It's about apes. Really? It's most fascinating, said the bursar, who was on the median part of his mental cycle, and therefore vaguely on the right planet, even if insulated from it by five miles of mental cotton wool. It's true what he said. It says here that an adult male orangutan doesn't grow the large flamboyant cheek pads unless he's the dominant male. Uh, and, and, and that's um, fascinating, is it? Well, yes, because he hasn't got them. I wonder why. He certainly dominates the library, I should think. Ah, yes, said the senior wrangler, but he knows he's a wizard too, so it's not as though he dominates the whole university. One by one, as the thought sank in, they grinned at the arch-chancellor. Uh, don't you look at my cheeks like that, said Ridcully. I don't dominate anybody. I was only... So you can all shut up there, or there will be big trouble. You should read it, said the bursar, still happily living in the Valley of the Dried Frogs. It's amazing what you can learn. What? Like how to show your bottom to people, said the dean from on high. No, dean, that's baboons, said the senior wrangler. I beg your pardon, I think you'll find it's gibbons, said the chair of indefinite studies. No, gibbons are the ones that hoot. It's baboons if you want to see bottoms. Well, he, he's never shown me one, said the arch-chancellor. Huh, well, he wouldn't, would he? said a voice from the chandelier. Not with you being dominant male and everything. Two chairs, you come down here this minute. I seem to be entangled, Mustrum. A candle is giving me some difficulty. Huh? Rincewind shook his head and wandered away. There had certainly been some changes around the place since he had been here, and if it came to it, he didn't know how long ago that had been. He'd never asked for an exciting life. What he really liked, what he sought on every occasion, was boredom. The trouble was that boredom tended to explode in your face. Just when he thought he'd found it, he'd be suddenly involved in what he supposed other people, thoughtless, feckless people, would call an adventure and he'd be forced to visit many strange lands and meet exotic and colourful people, although not for very long, because usually he'd be running. He'd seen the creation of the universe, although not from a good seat, and he had visited hell and the afterlife. He'd been captured, imprisoned, rescued, lost and marooned. Sometimes it had all happened on the same day. Adventure. People talked about the idea as if it was something worthwhile, rather than a mess of bad food, no sleep, and strange people inexplicably trying to stick pointed objects in bits of you. The root problem, Rincewind had come to believe, was that he suffered from preemptive karma. If it even looked as though something nice was going to happen to him in the near future, something bad would happen right now, and it went on happening to him right through the part where the good stuff should be happening so that he never actually experienced it. 
It was as if he always got the indigestion before the meal and felt so dreadful that he never actually managed to eat anything. Somewhere in the world, he reasoned, there was someone who was on the other end of the seesaw, a kind of mirror rinsewind whose life was a succession of wonderful events. He hopes to meet him one day, preferably while holding some sort of weapon. Now people were babbling about sending him to the counterweight continent. He'd heard that life was dull there, and Rincewind really craved dullness. He'd really liked that island. He'd enjoyed coconut surprise. You cracked it open, and hey, there was coconut inside. That was the kind of surprise he liked. He pushed open a door. The place inside had been his room. It was a mess. There was a large and battered wardrobe, and that was about the end of it as far as proper furniture was concerned, unless you wanted to broaden the term to include a wicker chair with no bottom, and three legs, and a mattress so full of the life that inhabits mattresses that it occasionally moved sluggishly around the floor, bumping into things. The rest of the room was a litter of objects dragged in from the street, old crates, bits of planking, sacks. Rincewind felt a lump in his throat. They'd left his room just as it was. He opened the wardrobe and rummaged through the moth-haunted darkness within, until his questing hand located an ear, which was attached to a dwarf. Ow! What, said Rincewind, are you doing in my wardrobe? Wardrobe? Uh, uh, isn't this the magic kingdom of scrumptiousness? said the dwarf, trying not to look guilty. No, and these shoes you're holding aren't the golden jewels of the Queen of the Fairies, said Rincewind, snatching them out of the thief's hands. And this isn't the Wand of Invisibility, and these aren't giant Grumblenose's wonderful socks. But this is my boot. Ow! And stay out. The dwarf ran for the door and paused, but only briefly to shout, I've got a Thieves' Guild card, and you shouldn't hit dwarfs. That's speciesism. Good, said Rincewind, retrieving items of clothing. He found another robe and put it on. Here and there moths had worked their lace-making skills, and most of the red colour had faded to shades of orange and brown, but to his relief it was a proper wizard's robe. It's hard to be an impressive magic user with bare knees. Gentle footsteps pattered to a halt behind him. He turned. Open. The luggage obediently cracked its lid. In theory, it should have been full of shark. In fact, it was half full of coconuts. Rincewind turfed them out onto the floor and put the rest of the clothes inside. Shut. The lid slammed. Now, go to the kitchen and get some potatoes. The chest did a complicated many-legged-about turn and trotted away. Rincewind followed it out and headed towards the Archchancellor's study. Behind him he could hear the wizards still arguing. He'd become familiar with the study through long years at Unseen. Generally, he was there to answer quite difficult questions, like, how can anyone get a negative mark in basic fire-making? He spent a lot of time staring at the fixtures while people harangued him. There had been changes here, too. Gone were the alembics and bubbling flagons that were the traditional props of wizardry. Ridcully's study was dominated by a full-size snooker table, on which he'd piled papers until there was no room for any more and no sign of green felt. Ridcully assumed that anything people had time to write down couldn't be important. The stuffed heads of a number of surprised animals stared down at him. From the antlers of one stag hung a pair of corroded boots Ridcully had won as a rowing brown for the university in his youth. Except during extreme flood conditions, it is extremely difficult to make much progress on the Ark, and the university rowing teams compete by running over the surface of the river. This is generally quite safe, provided they don't stand in one place for very long, and of course, it eats the soles off their boots. There was a large model of the disc world on four wooden elephants in a corner of the room. Rincewind was familiar with it. Every student was. The counterweight continent was a blob. It was a shaped blob, a not very inviting comma shape. Sailors had brought back news of it. They'd said at one point it broke into a pattern of large islands stretching around the disk to the even more mysterious islands of Bang Bang Duk and the completely mythical continent known only on the charts as XXXX. Not that many sailors went near the counterweight continent. The Agatean Empire was known to ignore a very small amount of smuggling. Presumably Ankh-Morpork had some things it wanted. 
but there was nothing official. A boat might come back loaded with silk and rare wood, and these days a few wild-eyed refugees, or it might come back with its captain riveted upside down to the mast, or it might not come back. Rincewind had been very nearly everywhere, but the counterweight continent was an unknown land, or terror incognita. He couldn't imagine why they'd want any kind of wizard. Rincewind sighed. He knew what he should do now. He shouldn't even wait for the return of the luggage from its argosy to the kitchens, from which the sound of yelling and something being repeatedly hit with a large brass preserving pan suggested it was going about its business. He should just gather up what he could carry and get the hell out of here. He... Ah, Rincewind, said the Arch-Chancellor, who had an amazingly silent walk for such a large man. Keen to leave, I see. Uh, yes, indeed, said Rincewind. Oh, oh, yes, very much so. The Red Army met in secret session. They opened their meeting by singing revolutionary songs, and since disobedience to authority did not come easily to the Agatean character, these had titles like Steady Progress and Limited Disobedience While Retaining Well-Formulated Good Manners. Then it was time for the news. The great wizard will come. We sent the message at great personal risk. How will we know when he arrives? If he's the great wizard, we'll hear about it. And then, gently push over the forces of repression, they chorused. Two fire herb looked at the rest of the cadre. Exactly, he said. And then, comrades, we must strike at the very heart of the rottenness. We must storm the Winter Palace. There was silence from the cadre. Then someone said, Excuse me, Two Fire Herb, but it is June. Then we can storm the Summer Palace. A similar session, although without singing and with rather older participants, was taking place in Unseen University, although one member of the College Council had refused to come down from the chandelier. This was of some considerable annoyance to the librarian, who usually occupied it. All right, if you don't trust my calculations, then what are the alternatives? said Ponder Stibbons hotly. Boat, said the chair of indefinite studies. They sink, said Rincewind. It'd get you there in no time at all, said Senior Wrangler. We're wizards after all. We could give you your own bag of wind. Ah, Forward the dean, said Ridcully pleasantly. I heard that, said a voice from above. Overland, said the lecturer in recent runes, up and around the hub. It's ice practically all the way. No, said Rincewind. But you don't sink on ice. No, you tip up and then you sink, and then the ice hits you on the head. Also, killer whales and great big seals with teeth like this. This is off the wall, I know, said the bursar brightly. What is, said the lecturer in recent runes. A hook for hanging pictures on. There was a brief embarrassed silence. Good Lord, is that the, um, time already? said the Arch-Chancellor, taking out his watch. Ah, so it is. The bottle's in your left-hand pocket, old chap. Take three. No, magic is the only way, said Ponder Stibbons. It worked when we brought him here, didn't it? Oh, yes, said Rincewind. Just send me thousands of miles with my pants on fire and you don't even know where I'll land. Oh, yes, that's ideal, that is. Good, said Rid Cully, a man impervious to sarcasm. It's a big continent. We can't possibly miss it, even with Mr. Stibbons' precise calculations. Supposing I end up crushed in the middle of a mountain, said Rincewind. Can't. The rock will be brought back here when we do the spell, said Ponder, who hadn't liked the crack about his mass. So I'll still be in the middle of a mountain, but in a me-shaped hole, said Rincewind. Oh, good. Instant fossil. Don't worry, said Ridcully. It's just a matter of, um, uh, thingamy. You know, all that stuff about three right angles making a triangle. Is it possible you're talking about geometry, said Rincewind, eyeing the door? That 
kind of thing.、Mm, yes, and you'll have your amazing luggage item. Why, it'll practically be a holiday. It'll be easy. They probably just want to to ask you something or something. And I hear you've got a talent for languages, so no problem there. This, at least, was true. Rincewind could scream for mercy in nineteen languages and just scream in another forty-four. This is important. Inexperienced travellers might think that "arg" is universal, but in Betrobi it means highly enjoyable, and in Hawanderland it means variously "I would like to eat your foot," "Your wife is a big hippo," and "Hello," thinks Mr. Purple Cat. One particular tribe has a fearsome reputation for cruelty, merely because prisoners appear to them to be shouting, "Quick, extra boiling oil!" You'll probably be away for a couple of hours at the most. Why do you keep saying <laughs> under your breath? Was I? And everyone will be so grateful if you come back. Rincewind looked around, and in one case, up at the council. How will I get back? He said. Same way you went. We'll find you and 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 bring you out with surgical precision. Rincewind groaned. He knew what surgical precision meant in Ark Morpork. It meant to within an inch or two, accompanied by a lot of screaming, and then they pour hot tar on you just where your leg was. But if you put aside for the moment the certainty that something would definitely go horribly wrong. It looked foolproof. The trouble was that wizards were such ingenious fools. And then I can have my old job back. Oh, certainly. And officially call myself a wizard.、Oh, of course, with any kind of spelling. And never have to go anywhere again as long as I live. Fine. We'll actually ban you leaving the premises if you like. And a new hat. What? A, a new hat. This one's practically headed. Two new hats. Sequins, of course. And those, you know, like glass chandelier things. Lots of those all around the brim, as many as you like. And we'll spell wizard with three Z's. Rincewind sighed. Oh, all right, I'll do it. Ponder's genius found itself rather cramped when it came to explaining things to people, and this was the case now, as the wizards foregathered to kick some serious magic. Ah, yes, but you see, Arch Chancellor, he's being sent to the opposite side of the disc. You see, Rid Cully sighed. It's、um, spinning, isn't it? He said. We're all going the same way. It stands to reason. If people are going the other way just because they're on the counterweight continent, we'd crash into them once a year. I mean, twice. Yes, yes, they're spinning the same way, of course, but the direction of motion is entirely opposite. I mean, said Ponder, lapsing into logic. You have to think about vectors. You, you, you have to ask yourself what direction would they go in if the disc wasn't here. The wizards stared at him.、Uh, down, said Ridcully. No, 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 Arch Chancellor said Ponder. They wouldn't go down because there'd be nothing to pull them down. They, you don't need anything to pull you down. Down's where you go if there's nothing to keep you up. They'd keep on going in the same direction, shouted Ponder. Right. Ah. Round and round," said Ridcully. He rubbed his hands together. "You've got to maintain a grip if you want to be a wizard, lad. <laughs> How are we doing, Runes?" I, um, "I, I can make out something," said the lecturer in recent Runes, squinting into the crystal ball. "There's a lot of interference." The wizards gathered round. White specks filled the crystal. There were vague shapes just visible in the mush. Some of them could be human. Very peaceful place, the Agatean Empire," said Ridcully. "Very tranquil, very cultured. They set great store in politeness." "Well, yes," said the lecturer in recent rooms. "I heard it was because people who aren't tranquil and quiet get serious bits cut off, don't they?"
I heard the Empire has a tyrannical and repressive government. What form of government is that? said Ponder Stibbons. A tautology, said the Dean from above. How um, serious are these bits? said Rincewind. They ignored him. I heard that gold's very common there, said the Dean. Lying around like dirt, they say. Rincewind could bring back a sackful. I'd um, rather bring back all my bits, said Rincewind. After all, he thought, I'm only the one who's going to end up in the middle of it all, so please don't anyone bother to listen to me. Can't you stop it blurring like that, said the Arch-Chancellor. I'm sorry, Arch-Chancellor. These bits. Um, big bits or small bits, said Rincewind, unheard. Just find us an open space with something about the right size and weight. It's very hard to... Very serious bits, are we in arms and legs territory here? They say it's very, very boring there. Their biggest curse is, may you live in interesting times, apparently. There's a thing. It's very blurry. It looks like a wheelbarrow or something. Quite small, I think. Or toes or ears or that kind of thing. Good. Let's get started, said Ridcully. Uh, I think it'll help if he's a bit heavier than the thing we move here, said Ponder. He won't arrive at any speed then, I think. Yes, yes, thank you very much, Mr. Stibbons. Now, get in the circle and let us see that staff crackle. There's a good chap. Um, fingernails? Hair? Rincewind tugged at the robe of Ponder Stibbons, who seemed slightly more sensible than the others. Um, what's my next move here, he said. Um, about six thousand miles, I hope, said Ponder Stibbons. But, I mean, have you got any advice? Ponder wondered how to put things. He thought, I've done my best with Hex, but the actual business will be undertaken by a bunch of wizards whose idea of experimental procedure is to throw it and then sit down and argue about where it's going to land. We want to change your position with that of something six thousand miles away, which, whatever the Arch-Chancellor says, is heading through space in a quite different direction. The key is precision. It's no good using any old travelling spell. It had come apart halfway, and so would you. I'm pretty sure that we'll get you there in one, or at worst, two pieces. But we've no way of knowing the weight of the things we change you with. If it's pretty much the same weight as you, then it might just all work out, provided you don't mind jogging on the spot when you land. But if it's a lot heavier than you, then my suspicion is that you'll appear over there travelling at the sort of speed normally only experienced by sleepwalkers in cliff-top villages in a very terminal way. Um, he said, be afraid. Be very afraid. Oh, that, said Rincewind. No problem there. I'm good at that. We're going to try to put you in the centre of the continent where Hung Hung is believed to be, said Ponder. The capital city? Yes, uh, Ponder felt guilty. Look, whatever happens, I'm sure you'll get there alive, which is more than would happen if it had just been left to them, and I'm pretty sure you'll end up on the right continent. Oh, good. Uh, come along, Mr. Stibbons, we're all agog to hear how you wish us to do this, said Ridcully. Ah, uh, yes, right. Now, you, Mr. Rincewind, if you will go and stand in the centre of the octagon, thank you. Mm, you see, gentlemen, what has always been the problem with teleporting over large distances is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Named after the wizard Sangrit Heisenberg, and not after the more famous Heisenberg, who is renowned for inventing what is possibly the finest lager in the world. Since the object teleported, that's from tele I see and porte to go, the whole meaning I see it's gone, uh, the object teleported, uh, no matter how large, is reduced to a thalmic particle and is therefore the subject of an eventually fatal dichotomy. It can either know what it is or where it is going, but not both.
Nah, the tension this creates in the morphic field eventually causes it to disintegrate, leaving the subject as a randomly shaped object um, smeared across up to eleven dimensions. Uh, but I'm sure you all know this. There was a snore from the chair of indefinite studies, who was suddenly giving a lecture in room 3D. Rincewind was grinning. At least his mouth had gaped open and his teeth were showing. Uh, excuse me, he said. I don't remember anyone saying anything about being smi- Of course, said Ponder, the subject would not, uh, actually experience this. Oh, as far as we know. What? Although it is theoretically possible for the psyche to remain present. Eh? Hey? To briefly witness the explosive discorporation. Eh? Hey? Now, we're all familiar with the use of the spell as a fulcrum, uh, so that one does not actually move one object, but simply exchanges the position of two objects of similar mass. It is my aim tonight uh, to demonstrate that by imparting exactly the right amount of spin and the maximum velocity to the object, me, from the very first moment it is virtually certain, virtually to hold together for distances of up to uh, 6,000 miles. Up to, give or take 10%. Give or take? So, if you'd excuse me, Dean, I'd be obliged if you'd stop dripping wax. If you'd all take up the positions I've marked on the floor... Rincewind looked longingly towards the door. It was no distance at all for the experienced coward. He could just trot out of here, and they could... They could... Uh, what could they do? They could just take his hat away and stop him ever coming back to the university. Now he came to think about it, they probably wouldn't be bothered about the nailing bit if he was too much bother to find. And that was the problem. He wouldn't be dead, but then neither would he be a wizard. And, he thought, as the wizards shuffled into position and screwed down the knobs on the end of their staffs, not being able to think of himself as a wizard was being dead. The spell began. Rincewind the shoemaker, Rincewind the beggar, Rincewind the thief. Just about everything apart from Rincewind the corpse demanded training or aptitudes that he didn't have. He was no good at anything else. Wizardry was the only refuge. Well, actually, he was no good at wizardry either, but at least he was definitively no good at it. He'd always felt he had a right to exist as a wizard, in the same way that you couldn't do proper maths without the number zero, which wasn't a number at all, but if it went away, would have a lot larger numbers looking bloody stupid. It was a vaguely noble thought that kept him warm during those occasional 3 a.m. awakenings when he had evaluated his life and found it weighed a little less than a puff of warm hydrogen. And he probably had saved the world a few times, but it had generally happened accidentally while he was trying to do something else. So you almost certainly didn't actually get any karmic points for that. It probably only counted if you started out by thinking in a loud way, by criminy, it's jolly well time to save the world, and no two ways about it, instead of, oh shit, this time I'm really going to die. The spell continued. It didn't seem to be going very well. Oh, come on, you chaps, said Ridcully. Put some backbone into it. Are you sure it's just something small, said the dean, who'd broken into a sweat. Looks like a, a wheelbarrow, muttered the lecturer in recent runes. The knob on the end of Ridcully's staff began to smoke. Will you look at the magic I'm using, he said. What's going on, Mr. Stibbons? Uh, of course, size isn't the same as mass. And then in the same way that it can take considerable effort to push at a sticking door, and no effort at all to fall full length into the room beyond, the spell caught. Ponder hoped afterwards that what he saw was an optical illusion. Certainly no one normally was suddenly stretched to about twelve feet tall, and then snapped back into shape so fast that their boots ended up under their chin. There was a brief cry of, <coughs> which ended abruptly, and this was probably just as well. The first thing that struck Rincewind when he appeared on the counterweight continent was a cold sensation. The next things, in order of the direction of travel, were a surprised man with a sword, another man with a sword, 
a third man who dropped his sword and was trying to run away, two other men who were less alert and didn't even see him, a small tree, about fifty yards of stunted undergrowth, a snowdrift, a bigger snowdrift, a few rocks, and one more and quite final snowdrift. Rid Cully looked at Ponder Stibbons. Well, he's gone, he said. But aren't we supposed to get something back? I'm not sure the transit time is instantaneous, said Ponder. You've got to allow for uh, zooming through the occult dimensions time. Something like that. According to Hex, we might have to wait several... Something appeared in the octagon with a pop, exactly where Rincewind had been, and rolled a few inches. It did at least have four small wheels, such as might carry a cart, but these weren't workmanlike wheels, they were mere discs, such as might be put on something heavy for those rare occasions it needs to be moved. Above the wheels, things became rather more interesting. There was a large round cylinder, like a barrel on its side. A considerable amount of effort had been put into its construction. Large amounts of brass had gone into making it look like a very large, fat dog with his mouth open. A minor feature was a length of string, which was smoking and hissing because it was on fire. It didn't do anything dangerous, it just sat there while the smouldering string slowly got shorter. The wizards gathered round. Looks pretty heavy, said the lecturer in recent runes. A statue of a dog with a big mouth, said the chair of indefinite studies. That's rather dull. Bit of a uh, lap dog, too, said Rid Cully. Lot of work gone into it, said the dean. Can't imagine why anyone would want to set fire to it. Rid Cully poked his head into the wide tube. Some kind of big round ball in here, he said, his voice echoing a little. Someone pass me a staff or something. I'll see if I can wiggle it out. Ponder was staring at the fizzing string. Ah, uh, he said, I, uh, I think we should all just step away from it, Arch-Chancellor. Uh, we should all just step back. Yes, um, step back a little way. Uh, Oh, yes, really. So much for research, said Ridcully. You don't mind messing around with cogwheels and ants, but when it comes to really trying to find out how things work and getting your hands dirty, said the lecturer in recent rooms, yes, getting your hands dirty, you'll come over all shy. It's not that, Arch-Chancellor, said Ponder, but I believe it may be dangerous. I think I'm working it loose, said Rid Cully, poking the depths of the tube. Come on, you fellows, tip the thing up a bit. Ponder took a few more steps back. Uh, I really don't think, he began. Don't think, eh? Call yourself a wizard and you don't think. Blast, I've got my staff wedged now. That's what comes of listening to you when I should have been paying attention, Mr. Stibbons. Ponder heard a scuffling behind him. The librarian, with an animal's instinct for danger and a human's instinct for trouble, had upturned a table and was peering over the top of it with a small cauldron on his head, the handle under one of his chins like a strap. Arch-Chancellor, I, I really do think. Oh, you think, do you? Did anyone tell you it's your job to think? Ow, it's got my fingers now, thanks to you. It needed all Ponder's courage to say, I think it might perhaps be some kind of firework, sir. The wizards turned their attention to the fizzing string. What, coloured lights and uh, stars, uh, uh, that sort of thing, said Rid Cully. Possibly, sir. Must be planning a hell of a display. Apparently they're very keen on firecrackers over in the Empire. Ridcully spoke in the tone of voice of a man over whom the thought is slowly stealing that he just might have done something very silly. Would you like me to extinguish the string, sir? said Ponder. Uh, yes, dear boy, why not? Good idea. Um, good thinking, that man. Ponder stepped forward and pinched the string. I do hope we haven't ruined something, he said. Rincewind opened his eyes. This was not cool sheets. It was white, 
and it was cold, but it lacked basic sheetness. It made up for this by having vast amounts of snowosity and a groove, a long groove. Let's see now. He could remember the sensation of movement, and he vaguely remembered something small but incredibly heavy-looking, roaring past in the opposite direction. And then he was here, moving so fast that his feet left this groove. Yes, groove, he thought, in the easy-going way of the mildly concussed, with people lying around it, groaning. But they looked like the people who, once they'd stopped crawling around groaning, were going to draw the swords they had about their persons and pay detailed attention to serious bits. He stood up a little shakily. There didn't seem to be anywhere to run to. There was just this wide, snowy waste with a border of mountains. The soldiers were definitely looking a lot more conscious. Rincewind sighed. A few hours ago, he'd been sitting on a warm beach with young women about to offer him potatoes. There was still a certain amount of confusion on this point. And here he was on a windswept, chilly plain with some large men about to offer him violence. The soles of his shoes, he noticed, were steaming. And then someone said, Hey, are you? You're not, are you? Are you? What's the name? Rincewind, isn't it? Rincewind turned. There was a very old man behind him. Despite the bitter wind, he was wearing nothing except a leather loincloth and a grubby beard so long that the loincloth wasn't really necessary, at least from the point of view of decency. His legs were blue from the cold and his nose was red from the wind, giving him an overall quite patriotic look if he were from the right country. He had a patch over one eye, but rather more notable than that were his teeth. They glittered. Don't stand there gawping like a big gawper. Get these damn things off me. There were heavy shackles around his ankles and wrists. A chain led to a group of more or less similarly clad men who were huddling in a crowd and watching Rincewind in terror. Hey, they think you're some kind of demon, cackled the old man. But I knows a wizard when I sees one. That bastard over there has got the keys. Go and give him a good kicking. Rincewind took a few hesitant steps towards the recumbent guard and snatched at his belt. Right, said the old man. Now, chuck them over here, and then get out of the way. Why? Because you don't want to get blood all over you. But you haven't got a weapon, and there's one of you, and they've got big swords, and there's five of them. I know, said the old man, wrapping the chain around one of his fists in a business-like manner. It's unfair, but I can't wait around all day, he grinned. Gems glittered in the morning light. Every tooth in the man's head was a diamond and Rincewind knew of only one man who had the nerve to wear troll teeth. Here? Cohen the Barbarian? Shush! Incognita! Now, get out the way, I said. The teeth flashed at the guards who were now vertical. Come on, boys, there's five of you after all, and I'm an old man. Mumble, mumble, ooh, me leg, etc. To their credit, the guards hesitated. It was probably not to judge from their faces because there's something reprehensible about five large, heavily beweaponed men attacking a frail old man. It might have been because there's something odd about a frail old man who keeps on grinning in the face of obvious oblivion. Oh, come on, said Cohen. The men edged closer, each waiting for one of the others to make the first move. Cohen took a few steps forward, waving his arms wearily. Oh, no, he said. It makes me ashamed. Honestly, it does. This is not how you attack someone, all milling around like a lot of millers. When you attack someone, the important thing to remember is the element of surprise. And ten seconds later, he turned to Rincewind. All right, Mr. Wizard, you can open your eyes now. One guard was upside down in a tree, one was a pair of feet sticking out of a snowdrift, two were slumped against the rocks, and one was generally around the place, here and there, certainly hanging out. Cohen sucked his wrist thoughtfully. I reckon that last one came within an inch of getting me, he said. I must be getting old. Why are you here? Rincewind paused. One packet of curiosity overtook the first one. How old are you, exactly? Is this still the century of the fruit bat? Yes. Oh, I don't know. Ninety? Could be ninety. 
Maybe 95. Cohen fished the keys out of the snow and ambled over to the group of men who were cowering even more. He unlocked the first set of manacles and handed the shocked prisoner the keys. Bagger off the lot of you, he said, not unkindly, and don't get caught again. He strolled back to Rincewind. What brings you to this dump, then? Well, interesting, said Cohen, and that was that. But can't stay chatting all day, got work to do. You coming, or what? What? Please yourself. Cohen tied the chain around his waist as a makeshift belt, and wedged a couple of swords in it. Incidentally, he said, what did you do with the barking dog? What dog? I expect it doesn't matter. Rincewind scuttled after the retreating figure. It wasn't that he felt safe when Cohen the Barbarian was round. No one was safe when Cohen the Barbarian was around. Something seemed to have gone wrong with the aging process there. Cohen had always been a barbarian hero because barbaric heroing was all he knew how to do. And while he got old, he seemed to get harder, like Oak. But he was a known figure, and therefore comforting. He just wasn't in the right place. No future in it, back round the ram tops, said Cohen, as they trudged through the snow. Fences and farms, fences and farms everywhere. You kill a dragon these days, people complain. You know what? You know what happened? No, what happened? Man came up to me, said my teeth were offensive to trolls. What about that, eh? Well, they are made of... I said they never complained to me. Um, did you give them a chart? I said, I see a troll up in the mountains with a necklace of human skulls. I say, good luck to him. Silicon Anti-Defamation League, my bottom. It's the same all over. So I thought I'd try my luck the other side of the ice cap. Isn't it dangerous going around the hub? said Rincewind. Used to be, said Cohen, grinning horribly. Until you left, you mean. That's right. You've still got that box on legs. On and off. It hangs around, you know. Cohen chuckled. I'll get the bloody lid off that thing one day, mark my words. Ah, horses. There were five, looking depressed in a small depression. Rincewind looked back at the freed prisoners, who seemed to be milling around aimlessly. We're not taking all five horses, are we? Sure, we might need them. But one for me, one for you, what's the rest for? Lunch, dinner and breakfast? Well, it's a little unfair, isn't it? Those people look a bit bewildered. Cohen sneered the sneer of a man who has never been truly imprisoned, even when he's been locked up. I freed them, he said. First time they've ever been free. Comes as a bit of a shock, I expect. They're waiting for someone to tell them what to do next. Um, I could tell them to starve to death if you like. Um, oh, all right, you lot, fall me up he right now, toot sweet chop chop. The small crowd hurried over to Cohen and stood expectantly behind his horse. I tell you, I don't regret it. This is the land of opportunity, said Cohen, urging the horse into a trot. The embarrassed free men jogged behind. Know what? Swords are banned. No one except the army, the nobles and the imperial guard are allowed to own weapons. Couldn't believe it. God's own truth, though. Swords are outlawed. So only outlaws have swords. And that, said Cohen, giving the landscape another glittering grin, suits me fine. But you were in chains, Rincewind ventured. Glad you reminded me, said Cohen. Yeah. We'll find the rest of the lads, then I'd better try and find who did it and talk to them about that. The tone of his voice suggested very clearly that all they were likely to say would be, Highly enjoyable. Your wife is a big hippo. Lads? No future in one man barbarianing, said Cohen. Got myself a... Uh, well, you'll see. Rincewind turned to look at the trailing party, and at the snow, and at Cohen. Uh, do you know where Hung Hung is? Yeah, it's the boss city. We're on our way, sort of. It's under siege right now. Siege? You mean like, lots of armies outside, everyone inside eating rats, that sort of thing? Yeah, but this is the counterweight continent sea, so it's a polite siege. 
Well, I call it a siege. The old emperor's dying, so the big families are all waiting to move in. That's how it goes in these parts. There's five different top knobs, and they're all watching one another, and no one's going to be first to move. You've got to think sideways to understand anything in this place. Cohen? Yes, lad? What the hell's going on? Lord Hong was watching the tea ceremony. It took three hours, but you couldn't hurry a good cuppa. He was also playing chess against himself. It was the only way he could find an opponent of his calibre. But currently things were stalemated because both sides were adopting a defensive strategy which was admittedly brilliant. Lord Hong sometimes wished he could have an enemy as clever as himself. Or, because Lord Hong was indeed very clever, he sometimes wished for an enemy almost as clever as himself, one perhaps given to flights of strategic genius with nevertheless the occasional fatal flaw. As it was, people were so stupid. They seldom thought more than a dozen moves ahead. Assassination was meat and drink to the Hung Hung court. In fact, meat and drink were often the means. It was a game that everyone played. It was just another kind of move. It was not considered good manners to assassinate the emperor, of course. The correct move was to put the emperor in a position where you had control. But moves at this level were very dangerous. Happy as the warlords were to squabble amongst themselves, they could be relied upon to unite against any who looked in danger of rising above the herd. And Lord Hong had risen like bread by making everyone else believe that while they were the obvious candidate for the emperorship, Lord Hong would be better than any of the alternatives. It amused him to know that they thought he was plotting for the Imperial Pearl. He glanced up from the board and caught the eye of the young woman who was busy at the tea table. She blushed and looked away. The door slid back. One of his men entered, on his knees. Yes, said Lord Hong. Er, oh, Lord. Lord Hong sighed. People seldom began like this when the news was good. What happened? He said, The one they call the Great Wizard arrived, O Lord, up in the mountains, riding on a dragon of wind. Or so they say, the messenger added quickly, aware of Lord Hong's views about superstition. Good, but I assume there is a but. Er, one of the barking dogs has been lost. The new batch that you commanded should be tested. We don't quite, uh, that is to say, we think Captain Three High Trees was ambushed, perhaps. Our information is somewhat confused. The, um, the informant says the great wizard magicked it away. The messenger crouched lower. Lord Hong merely sighed again. Magic. It had fallen out of favor in the Empire, except for the most mundane purposes. It was uncultured. It put power in the hands of people who couldn't write a decent poem to save their lives, and sometimes hadn't. He believed in coincidence a lot more than he did in magic. This is most vexing, said Lord Hong. He stood up and took his sword off the rack. It was long and curved, and had been made by the finest sword maker in the empire, who was Lord Hong. He'd heard it took twenty years to learn the art, so he'd stretched himself a little. It had taken him three weeks. People never concentrated. That was their trouble. The messenger groveled. The officer concerned has been executed, he said. The messenger tried to scrabble through the floor and decided to let truth stand in for honesty. Yes, he piped. Lord Hong swung. There was a hiss like the fall of silk, a thump and clatter as of a coconut hitting the ground and the tinkle of crockery. The messenger opened his eyes. He concentrated on his neck region, fearful that the slightest movement might leave him a good deal shorter. There were dire stories about Lord Hong's swords. Oh, do get up, said Lord Hong. He wiped the blade carefully and replaced the sword. Then he reached across and pulled a small black bottle from the robe of the tea girl. Uncorked, it produced a few drops that hissed when they hit the floor. Really, said Lord Hong, I wonder why people bother. He looked up. Lord Tang or Lord McSweeney has probably stolen the dog to vex me. 
Did the wizard escape? So it seems, O Lord. Good. See that harm almost comes to him, and send me another tea girl, one with a head. There was this to be said about Cohen. If there was no reason for him to kill you, such as you having any a large amount of treasure or being between him and somewhere he wanted to get to, then he was good company. Rincewind had met him a few times before, generally while running away from something. Cohen didn't bother over much with questions. As far as Cohen was concerned, people appeared, people disappeared. After a five-year gap, he'd just say, Oh, it's you. He never added, And how are you? You were alive, you were upright, and beyond that he didn't give a damn. It was a lot warmer beyond the mountains. To Rincewind's relief, a spare horse didn't have to be eaten because a leopardly sort of creature dropped off a tree branch and tried to disembowel Cohen. It had a rather strong flavour. Rincewind had eaten horse. Over the years he'd nerved himself to eat anything that couldn't actually wriggle off his fork. But he was feeling shaken enough without eating something you could call Dobbin. How did they catch you, he said, when they were riding again. Oh, I was busy. Cohen the Barbarian? Too busy to fight? I didn't want to upset the young lady. Couldn't help myself. Went down to a village to pick up some news. One thing led to another. Next thing, a load of soldiers were all over the place like cheap armour. And I can't fight that well with me arms shackled behind me back. Real nasty bugger in charge. Face I won't forget in hurry. Half a dozen of us were rounded up, made to push the barking dog thing all the way out here. Then we were chained to that tree, and someone lit a bit of string, and they all legged it behind a snowdrift. Except you came along and vanished it. I didn't vanish it. Not exactly, anyway. Cohen leaned across towards Rincewind. I reckon I know what it was, he said, and sat back, looking pleased with himself. Yes? I reckon... It was some kind of firework. They're very big on fireworks here. You mean the sort of things where you light the blue touch paper and stick it up your nose? Kids, only very silly wizards with bad sinus trouble do this. Sensible people go off to a roped-off enclosure where they can watch a heavily protected man in the middle distance light with the aid of a very long pole, something that goes pssst, and then they can shout for ready. They use them to drive evil spirits away. There's lots of evil spirits, see, because of all the slaughtering. Slaughtering? Rincewind had always understood that the Agatean Empire was a peaceful place. It was civilised. They invented things. In fact, he recalled, he'd been instrumental in introducing a few of their devices to Ankh Morpork. Simple, innocent things like clocks worked by demons and boxes that painted pictures and extra glass eyes you could wear over the top of your own eyes to help you see better, even if it did mean you made a spectacle of yourself. It was supposed to be dull. Oh, yeah, slaughtering, said Cohen. Like supposing the population is being a bit behind with its taxis. You pick some city where people are being troublesome, and kill everyone, and set fire to it, and pull down the walls, and plough up the ashes. That way you get rid of the trouble, and all the other cities are suddenly really well-behaved and polite, and all your back taxes turn up in a big rush, which is handy for governments, I understand. Then if they ever give trouble, you just have to say, Remember Nang Nang, or whatever, and they say, Where's Nang Nang? And you say, My point exactly. Good grief. If that sort of thing was tried back home... Ah, but this place has been going a long time. People think that's how a country is supposed to run. They do what they're told. The people here are treated like slaves. Cohen scowled. Now I've got nothing against slaves, you know, as slaves. Owned a few in my time. Been a slave once or twice. But where the slaves, what do you expect to find? Rincewind thought about this. Whips, he said at last. Yeah, got it in one. Whips. There's something honest about slaves and whips. Well, they ain't got whips here. They got something worse than whips. What? said Rincewind, looking slightly panicky. You'll find out. 
Rincewind found himself looking around at the half-dozen other prisoners who had trailed after them and were watching in awe from a distance. He'd given them a bit of leopard, which they'd looked at initially as if it was poison, and then eaten as if it was food. They're still following us, he said. Yeah, well, you did give them meat, cackled Cohen, starting to roll a post-prandial cigarette. Shouldn't have done that. Should have let them have the whiskers and the claws, and then you'd been amazed what they'd cook up. You know their big dish down on the coast? No. Pig's ear soup. Now, what's that tell you about a place, eh? Rincewind shrugged. Very provident people? Some other bugger pinches the pig. He turned in the saddle. The group of ex-prisoners shrank back. Now, see here, he said. I told you, you're free. Understand? One of the braver men spoke up. Yes, master. I ain't your master. You're free. You can go whenever you like. Excepting if you follow me, I'll kill the lot of you. And now, go away. Where, master? Anywhere. Somewhere not here. The men gave one another some worried looks, and then the whole group, as one man, turned and trotted away along the path. Probably go straight back to their village, he said, rolling his eyes. Worse than whips, I tell you. He waved a scrawny hand at the landscape as they rode on. Strange bloody country, he said. Did you know there's a wall all round the empire? That's to keep the barbarian invaders out. Oh, yes, very defensive, said Cohen sarcastically. Like, oh, my goodness, there's a twenty-foot wall, dear me, I suppose we'd just better ride off back over a thousand miles of step and not, e.g., take a look at the ladder possibilities inherent in that pine wood over there. No, it's to keep people in. And rules? They've got rules for everything. No one even goes to the privy without a piece of paper. Well, as a matter of fact, I myself... A piece of paper saying they can go is what I meant. Can't leave your village without a chit. Can't get married without a chit. Can't even have a sh... Oh, here we are. Yes, indeed, said Rincewind. Cohen glared at him. How did you know? he demanded. Rincewind tried to think. It had been a long day. In fact, it had, because of the thalmic equivalent of jet lag been several hours longer than most other days he'd experienced, and had contained two lunchtimes, neither of which had contained anything worth eating. Uh, I thought you were making a general philosophical point, he hazarded, like, um, we'd better make the best of it. I meant we're at my hideout, said Cohen. Rincewind stared around them. There were scrubby bushes, a few rocks, and a sheer cliff face. I can't see anything, he said. Yep. That's how you can tell it's mine. The art of war was the ultimate basis of diplomacy in the Empire. Clearly, war had to exist. It was a cornerstone of the processes of government. It was the way the Empire got its leaders. The competitive examination system was how it got its bureaucratic and public officials, and warfare was for its leaders, perhaps, only a different kind of competitive examination. Admittedly, if you lost, you probably weren't allowed to resit next year. But there had to be rules. Otherwise, it was just a barbaric scuffle. So, hundreds of years ago, the art of war had been formulated. It was a book of rules. Some were very specific. There was to be no fighting within the Forbidden City. The person of the Emperor was sacrosanct. And some were more general guidelines for the good and civilized conduct of warfare. There were the rules of position, of tactics, of the enforcement of discipline, of the correct organization of supply lines. The art laid down the optimum course to take in every conceivable eventuality. It meant that warfare in the Empire had become far more sensible, and generally consisted of short periods of activity, followed by long periods of people trying to find things in the index. No one remembered the author. Some said it was one Tzu Tsung. Some claimed it was three Sun Tsung. Possibly it was even some unsung genius who had penned, or rather painted, the very first principle, Know the enemy and know yourself. Lord Hong felt that he knew himself very well, and seldom had trouble knowing his enemies, and he made a point of keeping his enemies alive and healthy. Take the lords Sung, Fang, Tang, and McSweeney. 
He cherished them. He cherished their adequacy. They had adequate military brains, which was to say that they had memorized the five rules and nine principles of the art of war. They wrote adequate poetry, and were cunning enough to counter such coups as were attempted in their own ranks. They occasionally sent against him assassins who were sufficiently competent to keep Lord Hong interested and observant and entertained. He even admired their adequate treachery. No one could fail to realize that Lord Hong would be the next emperor, but when it came to it, they would nevertheless contest the throne, at least officially. In fact, each warlord had privately pledged his personal support to Lord Hong, being adequately bright to know what was likely to happen if he didn't. There would still have to be a battle, of course, for custom's sake, but Lord Hong had a place in his heart for any leader who would sell his own men. Know your enemy. Lord Hong had decided to find a worthwhile one. So Lord Hong had seen to it that he got books and news from Ankh Morpork. There were ways. He had his spies. At the moment, Ankh Morpork didn't know it was the enemy, and that was the best kind of enemy to have. And he had been amazed and then intrigued and finally lost in admiration for what he saw. I should have been born there, he thought, as he watched the other members of the Serene Council. Oh, for a game of chess with someone like Lord Vetinari. No doubt he would carefully watch the board for three hours before he even made his first move. Lord Hong turned to the Serene Council's minutes eunuch. Can we get on, he said. The man licked his brush nervously. Nearly finished, O oh Lord, he said. Lord Hong sighed. Damn calligraphy. There would be changes. A written language of seven thousand letters, and it took all day to write a thirteen-syllable poem about a white pony trotting through wild hyacinths. And that was fine and beautiful, he had to concede, and no one did it better than Lord Hong. But Ankh Morpork had an alphabet of twenty-six unexpressive, ugly, crude letters, suitable only for peasants and artisans, and had produced poems and plays that left white-hot trails across the soul. And you could also use it to write the bloody minutes of a five-minute meeting in less than a day. How far have you got? he said. The eunuch coughed politely. How softly the bloom of the apricot he began. Yes, 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 said Lord Hong. Could we on this occasion dispense with the poetic framework, please? Ah, the minutes of the last meeting were duly signed. Is that all? Ah, you see, I have to finish painting the petals on... I wish this council to be concluded by this evening. Go away. The eunuch looked anxiously around the table, grabbed his scrolls and brushes, and scuttled out. Good, said Lord Hong. He nodded at the other warlords. He saved a special, friendly nod for Lord Tang. Lord Hong had prodded the thought with some intrigued interest, but it really did seem that Lord Tang was a man of honor. It was a rather cowed and crabbed honor, but it was definitely in there somewhere, and would have to be dealt with. It would be better in any case, my lords, if we spoke in private, he said. On the matter of the rebels, disturbing intelligence has reached me of their activities. Lord McSweeney nodded. I have seen to it that thirty rebels in Sum Dim have been executed, he said, as an example as an example of the mindlessness of Lord McSweeney, thought Lord Hong. To his certain knowledge, and none had better knowledge than he, there had not even been a cadre of the Red Army in some dim. But almost certainly there was one now. It was really too easy. The other warlords also made small but proud speeches about their efforts to turn barely noticeable unrest into bloody revolution, although they hadn't managed to see it like that. They were nervous under the bravado, like sheepdogs who'd had a glimpse of the world where the sheep did not run. Lord Hong cherished their nervousness. He intended to use it by and by. He smiled and smiled. Finally, he said, However, my lords, 
Despite your sterling efforts, the situation remains grave. I have information that a very senior wizard from Ankh-Morpork has arrived to assist the rebels here in Hung Hung, and that there is a plot to overthrow the good organization of the celestial world and assassinate the emperor. May he live for ten thousand years. I must naturally assume that the foreign devils are behind this. I know nothing of this, snapped Lord Tang. My dear Lord Tang, I was not suggesting that you should, said Lord Hong. I meant, Lord Tang began. Your devotion to the Emperor is unquestioned, Lord Hong continued as smoothly as a knife through warm butter. It is true that there is almost certainly someone highly placed assisting these people, but no one shred of evidence points to you. I should hope not. Indeed. The lords Fang and McSweeney moved very slightly away from Lord Tang. How can we have let this happen? Said Lord Fang. Certainly, it is true that people, foolish, deranged people, have sometimes ventured out beyond the wall. But to let one come back, I am afraid the Grand Vizier at the time was a man of changeable humours. Said Lord Hong. He thought it would be interesting to see what intelligence was brought back. Intelligence, said Lord Fang. The city of Ankh, more. Hawk is an abomination, mere anarchy. There appear to be no nobles of consequence, and the society is that of a termite nest. It would be better for us, my lords, if it was wiped from the face of the world. Your incisive comments are duly noted, Lord Fang," said Lord Hong, while part of him rolled on the floor laughing. In any event, he went on. I shall see that extra guards are posted in the emperor's chambers. However, all this trouble began. We must see that it ends here. He watched them, watching him. They think I want to rule the empire. He thought. So they're all, except for Lord Tang, rebel fellow traveller, as he will undoubtedly prove to be, working out how this will be to their advantage. He dismissed them and retired to his chambers. It was a fact that the ghosts and devils who lived beyond the wall had no grasp of culture and certainly no concept of books, and being in possession of such a patently impossible object was punishable by eventual death and confiscation. Lord Hong had built up quite a library; he had even acquired maps and more than maps. There was a box he kept locked in the room with the full-length mirror. Not now; later on. Ugh, more pork. Even the name sounded rich. All he needed was a year. The dreadful scourge of the rebellion would allow him to wield the kind of powers that even the maddest emperor had not dreamed of. And then it would be unthinkable not to build a vengeful fleet to wreak terror on the foreign devils. Thank you, Lord Fang. Your point is duly noted. As if it mattered who was emperor, the empire was possibly a bonus to be acquired later, perhaps in passing. Let him just have Ankh Morpork with its busy dwarfs and its grasp, above all, of machinery. Look at the barking dogs. Half the time they blew up. They were inaccurate. The principle was sound, but the execution was terrible, especially when they blew up. It had come as a revelation to Lord Hong when he looked at the problem the Ankh Morpork way and realized that it might just possibly be better to give the job of auspicious dog maker. To some peasant with a fair idea about metal and explosive earths, than to some clerk who'd got the highest marks in an examination to find the best poem about iron. In Ankh Morpork, people did things. Let him just walk down Broadway as owner and eat the pies of the famous Mister Dibbler. Let him play one game of chess against Lord Vetinari. Of course, it would mean leaving the man one arm. He was shaking with excitement. Not later, now. His fingers reached for the secret key on its chain around his neck. It was barely a track, 
rabbits would have walked right past it, and you would have sworn there was a sheer passless rock wall until you found the gap. Once you did find it, it was hardly worth the bother. It led to a long gully with a few natural caves in it, and a bit of grass and a spring. And as it turned out, Cohen's gang. Except that he called it a horde. They were sitting in the sun, complaining about how it wasn't as warm as it used to be. I'm back then, lads, said Cohen. Been away, have you? What? What's he say? He said he's back. Black what? Cohen beamed at Rincewind. I brought them with me, he said. Like I said, no future in going it alone these days. Um, said Rincewind, after surveying the little scene, are any of these men under eighty years old? Stand up, boy Willie, said Cohen. A dehydrated man, only marginally less wrinkled than the others, got to his feet. It was his feet that were particularly noticeable. He wore boots with extremely thick soles. So's me feet touch the ground, he said. Don't they, um, touch the ground in ordinary boots? No. Orthopedic problem, see? Like, you know how a lot of people got one leg shorter than the other? Funny thing, with me, it's... Don't tell me, said Rincewind. Sometimes I get these amazing flashes. Both legs are shorter than the other, right? Amazing. Of course, I can see you're a wizard, said Boy Willie. You'd know about this sort of thing. Rincewind gave the next member of the horde a bright, mad smile. It was almost certainly a human being, because wizened little monkeys didn't usually go around in a wheelchair while wearing a helmet with horns on. It grimaced at Rincewind. This is... What? What? Mad Hamish, said Coman. What? Who's he? I bet that wheelchair terrifies them, said Rincewind, especially the blades. We had the devil of a job getting it over the wall, Cohen conceded, but you'd be amazed at his turn of speed. What? And this is Truckle, the uncivil. Sod off, wizard. Rincewind beamed at Exhibit B. Those walking sticks, fascinating, very impressive the way you've got love and hate written on them. Cohen smiled proprietorially. Truckle used to be reckoned one of the biggest bad asses in the world, he said. Really? Him? But it's amazing what you can do with a herbal suppository. Up yours, mister, said Truckle. Rincewind blinked. Um, can I have a word, Cohen? He drew the ancient barbarian aside. I don't want to seem to be making trouble here, he said. But it doesn't strike you, does it, that these men are a bit, well, past their sell-by date? A little, not to put too fine a point on it, old? What? What's he seeing? He says it's cold. What? What are you saying? There's nearly five hundred years of concentrated barbarian hero experience in them, said Cohen. Five hundred years experience in a fighting unit is good, said Rincewind. It's good, but it should be spread over more than one person. I mean, what are you expecting them to do? Fall over on people? Nothing wrong with them, said Cohen, indicating a frail man who was staring intently at a large block of teak. Look at old Caleb the Ripper over there. See? Killed more than four hundred men with his bare hands. Eighty-five now, and but for the dust he's marvellous. What the hell is he doing? Ah, see? They're into bare-handed combat here. Very big thing, unarmed combat, on account of most people not being allowed weapons. So Caleb reckons he's onto a good thing. See that big lump of teak? It's amazing. He just gives this blood-curdling shout and... Cohen, they're all very old men. They're the cream. Rincewind sighed. Cohen, they're the cheese. Why have you brought them all the way here? Can I help me steal something? said Cohen. What, a jewel or something? It's something, said Cohen sulkily. It's in Hung Hung. Really, my word, said Rincewind, and there's a lot of people in Hung Hung, I expect. About half a million, said Cohen. Lots of guards, no doubt. About forty thousand, I heard. About three quarters of a million, if you count all the armies. Right, said Rincewind. So with these half-dozen old men... 
The Silver Horde, said Cohen with a touch of pride. What? Pardon? That's their name. Got to have a name in the Horde business. The Silver Horde. Rincewind turned around. Several of the Horde had fallen asleep. The Silver Horde, he said. Right. Matches the colour of their hair. Those that have got hair. So, with this um, Silver Horde, you're going to rush the city, kill all the guards, and steal all the treasure. Cohen nodded. Yeah, something like that. Of course, we won't have to kill all the guards. Oh, no? It'd take too long. Yes, and of course you'll want to leave something to do tomorrow. I mean, they'll be busy, what with the revolution and everything. A revolution, too, my word. They say it's a time of portents, said Cohen. They... I'm surprised they've got time to worry about the state of their camping equipment, said Rincewind. You'd be well advised to stay along with us, said Genghis Cohen. You'd be safer with us. Um, I'm not sure about that, said Rincewind, grinning horribly. I'm not sure about that at all. By myself, he thought. Only ordinary horrible things can happen to me. Cohen shrugged, and then stared around the clearing until his gaze lighted on a slight figure who was sitting a little apart from the rest, reading a book. Look at him, he said benevolently, like a man pointing out a dog doing a good trick. Oh, he's got his nose in a book. He raised his voice. Teach, come and show this wizard the way to Hung Hung. He turned back to Rincewind. Teach will tell you anything you want to know, because he knows everything. I'll leave you with him. I've got to go and have a talk with old Vincent. He waved a hand dismissively. Not that there's anything wrong with him at all, he said defiantly. It's just that his memory's bad. We had a bit of trouble on the way over. I keep telling him it's rape the women and set fire to the houses. Rape, said Rincewind. That's not very... He's eighty-seven, said Cohen. Don't go and spoil an old man's dreams. Teach turned out to be a tall, stick-like man with an amiably absent-minded expression and a fringe of white hair so that, when viewed from above, he would appear to be a daisy. He certainly did not appear to be a bloodthirsty brigand, even though he was wearing a chainmail vest slightly too big for him and a huge scabbard strapped across his back, which contained no sword but held a variety of scrolls and brushes. His chainmail shirt had a breast pocket with three different coloured pens in a leather pocket protector. Ronald Savaloy he said, shaking Rincewind's hand. The gentlemen do rather assume considerable knowledge on my part. Let me see, you want to go to Hung Hung, yes? Rincewind had been thinking about this. I want to know the way to Hung Hung, he said guardedly. Yes, well, at this time of year, I'd head towards the setting sun until I left the mountains and reached the alluvial plain, where you'll see evidence of drumlins and some quite fine examples of obviously erratic boulders. It's about ten miles. Rincewind stared at him. A brigand's directions were usually more along the lines of keep straight on past the burning city and turn right when you've passed all the citizens hanging up by their ears. Those drumlins sound dangerous, he said. They're just a type of post-glacial hill, said Mr. Savaloy. What about these erratic boulders? They sound like the kind of thing that'd pounce on. Just boulders dropped a long way from home by a glacier, said Mr. Savaloy. Nothing to worry about. The landscape is not hostile. Rincewind didn't believe him. He'd had the ground hit him very hard many times. However, said Mr. Savaloy, Hung Hung is a little dangerous at the moment. No. Really? said Rincewind wearily. It's not exactly a siege. Everyone's waiting for the Emperor to die. These are what they call here, he smiled. Interesting times. I hate interesting times. The other hoarders had wandered off, fallen asleep again, or were complaining to one another about their feet. The voice of Cohen could be heard somewhere in the distance. Look, this is a match, and this is... You know, you sound a very educated man for a barbarian, said Rincewind. Oh, dear me, I didn't start out a barbarian. I used to be a school teacher. That's why they call me teach. What do you teach? 
geography, and I was very interested in Oriental. The Ark Morpork name for the counterweight continent and its nearby islands. It means place where the gold comes from. Studies. But I decided to give it up and make my living by the sword. After being a teacher all your life? It did mean a change of perspective, yes. But, well, surely the privation, the terrible hazards, the daily risk of death. Mr. Savaloy brightened up. Oh, you've been a teacher, have you? Rincewind looked around when someone shouted. He turned to see two of the horde arguing nose to nose. Mr. Savaloy sighed. I'm trying to teach them chess, he said. It's vital to the understanding of the oriental mind, but I am afraid they have no concept of taking turns at moving, and their idea of an opening gambit is for the king and all the pawns to rush up the board together and set fire to the opposing rooks. Rincewind leaned closer. Look, I mean, Genghis Cohen, he said. Has he gone off his head? I mean... Just killing half a dozen geriatric priests and nicking some paste gems, yes. Attacking 40,000 guards all by himself is certain death. Oh, he won't be by himself, said Mr. Savaloy. Rincewind blinked. There was something about Cohen. People caught optimism off him, as though it was the common cold. Oh, yes, of course. Sorry, I'd forgotten that. Seven against forty thousand. I shouldn't think you'll have any problems. I'll just be going. Fairly quickly, I think. We have a plan. It's a sort of... Mr. Savaloy hesitated. His eyes unfocused slightly. You know, thing. Bees do it. Wasps, too. Also some jellyfish, I believe. Had the word only a moment ago. Ugh, it's going to be the biggest one ever, I think. Rincewind gave him another blank stare. I'm sure I saw a spare horse, he said. Let me give you this, said Mr. Savaloy. Then perhaps you'll understand. It's what it's all about, really. He handed Rincewind a small bundle of papers fastened together by a loop of string through one corner. Rincewind, shoving it hastily into his pocket, noticed only the title on the first page. It said, What I Did on My Holidays. The choices seemed very clear to Rincewind. There was the city of Hung Hung under siege, apparently throbbing with revolution and danger, and there was everywhere else. Therefore, it was important to know where Hung Hung was, so that he didn't blunder into it by accident. He paid a lot of attention to Mr. Savaloy's instructions, and then rode the other way. He could get a ship somewhere. Of course, the wizards would be surprised to see him back, but he could always say there'd been no one in. The hills gave way to scrubland, which in turn led down to an apparently endless damp plain, which contained in the misty distance a river so winding that half the time it must have been flowing backwards. The land was a checkerboard of cultivation. Rincewind liked the countryside in theory, providing it wasn't rising up to meet him and was for preference happening on the far side of a city wall. But this was hardly countryside. It was more like one big hedgeless farm. Occasional huge rocks, looking dangerously erratic, rose out of the fields. Sometimes he'd see people hard at work in the distance. As far as he could tell, their chief activity was moving mud around. Occasionally he'd see a man standing ankle-deep in a flooded field, holding a water buffalo on the end of a length of string. The buffalo grazed and occasionally moved its bowels. The man held the string. It seemed to be his entire goal and occupation in life. There were a few other people on the road. Usually they were pushing wheelbarrows loaded with water buffalo dung, or possibly mud. They didn't pay any attention to Rincewind. In fact, they made a point of not paying attention. They scurried past, staring intently at the scenes of mud dynamics or bovine bowel movement happening in the fields. Rincewind would be the first to admit that he was a slow thinker. In fact, he'd be about the 73rd to admit it. But he'd been around long enough to spot the signs. These people weren't paying him any attention because they didn't see people on horseback. They were probably descended from people who learned that if you look too hard at anyone on horseback, you receive a sharp, stinging sensation, such as might be obtained by a stick around the ear. 
Not looking up at people on horseback had become hereditary. People who stared at people on horseback in what was considered to be a funny way never survived long enough to breed. He decided to try an experiment. The next wheelbarrow that trundled past was carrying not mud but people, about half a dozen of them, on seats either side of the huge central wheel. The method of propulsion was secondarily by a small sail erected to catch the wind, but primarily by that pre-eminent source of motive power in a peasant community, someone's great-grandfather, or at least someone who looked like someone's great-grandfather. Cohen had said, There's men here who can push a wheelbarrow for thirty miles in a bowl of millet with a bit of scum in it. What does that tell you? It tells me someone's porking all the beef. Rincewind decided to explore the social dynamics and also try out the language. It had been years since he'd last used it, but he had to admit that Rid Cully had been right. He did have a gift for languages. Agatean was a language of a few basic syllables. It was really all in the tone, inflection, and context. Otherwise, the word for military leader was also the word for long-tailed marmot, male sexual organ, and ancient chicken coop. Hey there, you, he shouted. Er, uh, to bend bamboo? An expression of disapproval? Er, uh, I mean, stop? The barrow slewed to a halt. No one looked at him. They looked past him, or around him, or towards his feet. Eventually the wheelbarrow pusher, in the manner of a man who knows he's in for it no matter what he does, mumbled, Your honour commands? Rincewind felt very sorry later for what he said next. He said, Just give me all your food, and unwilling dogs, will you? They watched him impassively. Damn, I mean... Arranged beetles? Uh, variety of waterfall? Um, oh, yes, money. There was a general fumbling and shifting among the passengers. Then the wheelbarrow pusher sidled towards Rincewind, head down, and held up his hat. It contained some rice, some dried fish, a highly dangerous-looking egg, and about a pound of gold in big round coins. Rincewind stared at the gold. Gold was as common as copper on the counterweight continent. That was one of the few things everyone knew about the place. There was no point in Cohen trying any kind of big robbery. There was a limit to what anyone could carry. He might as well rob one peasant village and live like a king for the rest of his life. It wouldn't be as if he'd need that much. The later suddenly caught up with him, and he did indeed feel quite ashamed. These people had hardly anything, apart from loads of gold. Er, uh, thanks. Thank you. Yes, um, just checking. Yes, you can all have it back now. I'll, um, keep the elderly grandmother to run sideways. Oh, damn, uh, fish. Rincewind had always been on the bottom of the social heap. It didn't matter what size heap it was. The top got higher or lower, but the bottom was always in the same place. But at least it was an ankh Morpork heap. No one bowed to anyone in ankh Morpork and anyone who tried what he'd just tried in ankh Morpork would by now be scrabbling in the gutter for his teeth and whimpering about the pain in his groin, and his horse would already have been repainted twice and sold to a man who'd be swearing he'd owned it for years. He felt oddly proud of the fact. Something strange welled up from the sludgy depths of his soul. It was, to his amazement, a generous impulse. He slid off the horse and held out the reins. A horse was youthful, but he was used to doing without one. Besides, over a short distance a man could run faster than a horse, and this was a fact very dear to Rincewind's heart. Here, he said, you can have it, for the fish. The wheelbarrow pusher screamed, grabbed the handles of his conveyance, and hurtled desperately away. Several people were thrown off, took one almost look at Rincewind, also screamed, and ran after him. Worse than whips, Cohen had said. They've got something here worse than whips. They don't need whips any more. Rincewind hoped he'd never find out what it was, if it had done this to people. He rode on through an endless panorama of fields. There weren't even any patches of roadside scrub or taverns. Away among the fields were shapes that might be small towns or villages, but no apparent paths to them, possibly because paths used up valuable agricultural mud.
Finally, he sat down on a rock that presumably not even the peasant's most concerted efforts had been able to move, and reached into his pocket for his shameful dried fish lunch. His hand touched the bundle of papers Mr. Savaloy had given him. He pulled them out and got crumbs on them. This is what it's all about, the barbarian teacher had said. He hadn't explained what it was. What I did on my holidays, said the title. It was in bad handwriting, or rather bad painting. The Agateans wrote with paintbrushes, assembling little word pictures out of handy components. One picture wasn't just worth a thousand words, it was a thousand words. Rincewind wasn't much good at reading the language. There were very few Agatean books, even in the unseen university library, and this one looked as though whoever had written it had been trying to make sense of something unfamiliar. He turned over a couple of pages. It was a story about a great city containing magnificent things. Beer strong like an ox, it said, and pies containing many, many parts of pig. Everyone in the city seemed to be wise, kind, strong, or all three, especially some character called the Great Wizard, who seemed to feature largely in the text. And there were mystifying little comments, as in, I saw a man tread upon the toes of a city guard who said to him, Your wife is a big hippo, to which the man responded, Place it where the sun does not shed daylight enormous person. Upon which the guard, this bit was in red ink, and the handwriting was shaky, as if the writer was quite excited, did not remove the man's head according to ancient custom. The statement was followed by a pictogram of a dog passing water, which was for some obscure reason the Agatean equivalent of an exclamation mark. There were five of these. Rincewind flicked through the pages. They were filled with the same dull stuff, sentences stating the blindingly obvious, but often then followed by several incontinent dogs, such as, the innkeeper said the city had demanded tax, but he did not intend to pay, and when I asked if he was not afraid, he vouchsafed, complicated pictogram, them all except one, and he can, complicated pictogram, himself. Urinating dog, urinating dog. He went on to say, the pictogram indicating supreme ruler is a, another pictogram, which after some thought and holding up the picture at various angles, Rincewind decided meant a horse's bottom, and you can tell him I said so at which point a guard in the tavern did not disembowel him, urinating dog, urinating dog, but said, tell him from me also, urinating dog, urinating dog, urinating dog, urinating dog, urinating dog. What was so odd about that? People talked like that in Ankh Morpork all the time, or at least expressed those sentiments, apart from the dog. Mind you, a country that had wiped out a whole city to teach the other cities a lesson was a mad place. Perhaps this was a book of jokes, and he just hadn't seen the point. Perhaps comedians here got big laughs with lines like, I say, I say, I say, I met a man on the way to the theatre, and he didn't chop my legs off, urinating dog, urinating dog. He had been aware of the jingle of harnesses on the road, but hadn't paid it any attention. He hadn't even looked up at the sound of someone approaching. By the time he did think of looking up, it was too late, because someone had their boot on his neck. Oh, urinating dog, he said before passing out. There was a puff of air, and the luggage appeared, dropping heavily into a snowdrift. There was a meat cleaver sticking into its lid. It remained motionless for some time, and then, its legs moving in a complicated little dance, it turned around 360 degrees. The luggage did not think. It had nothing to think with. Whatever processes went on inside, it probably had more to do with the way a tree reacts to sun and rain and sudden storms, but speeded up very fast. After a while, it seemed to get its bearings and ambled off across the melting snow. The luggage did not feel either. It had nothing to feel with, but it reacted in the same way that a tree reacts to the changing of the seasons. Its pace quickened. It was close to home. Rincewind had to concede that the shouting man was right. Not, that is, about Rincewind's father being the diseased liver of a type of mountain panda and his mother being a bucket of turtle slime. Rincewind had no personal experience of either parent, but felt that they were probably at least vaguely humanoid, if only briefly. But on the subject of appearing to own a stolen horse, he had Rincewind bang to rights. And also, a foot on his neck. A foot on the neck is nine points of the law. He felt hands rummaging in his pockets. 
Another person, Rinswind was not able to see much beyond a few inches of alluvial soil, but from context it appeared to be an unsympathetic person, joined in the shouting. Rinswind was hauled upright. The guards were pretty much like guards as Rincewind had experienced them everywhere. They had exactly the amount of intellect required to hit people and drag them off to the scorpion pit. They were league champions at shouting at people a few inches from their face. The effect was made surreal by the fact that the guards themselves had no faces, or at least no faces they could call their own. Their ornate black enameled helmets had huge mustachioed visages painted on them, leaving only the owner's mouth uncovered, so that he could, for example, call Rincewind's grandfather a box of inferior goldfish droppings. What I did on my holidays was waved in front of his face. Bag of rotted fish! I don't know what it means, said Rincewind. Someone just gave it to me. Feet of extreme rotted milk! Could you perhaps not shout quite so loud? I think my eardrum has just exploded. The guard subsided, possibly only because he'd run out of breath. Rincewind had a moment to look at the scenery. There were two carts on the road. One of them seemed to be a cage on wheels. He made out faces watching him in terror. The other was an ornate palanquin carried by eight peasants. Rich curtains covered the sides, but he could see where they'd been twitched aside so that someone within could look at him. The guards were aware of this. It seemed to make them awkward. If I could just explain... Silence! Mouth of... The guard hesitated. You've used turtle, goldfish, and what you probably meant to be cheese, said Rincewind. Mouth of chicken gizzards! A long, thin hand emerged from the curtains and beckoned just once. Rincewind was hustled forward. The hand had the longest fingernails he'd ever seen on something that didn't purr. Cow-tow! Sorry, said Rincewind. Cow-tow! Swords were produced. I don't know what you mean, Rincewind wailed. Cow-tow, please! whispered a voice by his ear. It was not a particularly friendly voice, but compared to all the other voices, it was positively affectionate. It sounded as though it belonged to quite a young man, and it was speaking very good Morporkian. How? You don't know that. Kneel down, press your forehead on the ground. That's if you want to be able to wear a hat again. Rincewind hesitated. He was a free-born Morporkian, and on the list of things a citizen didn't do was bow down to any, not to put too fine a point on it, foreigner. On the other hand, right at the top of the list of things a citizen didn't do was get their head chopped off. That's better, that's good. How did you know you ought to tremble? Oh, I, um, I thought that bit up myself. The hand beckoned with a finger. A guard slapped Rincewind in the face with a mud-encrusted, what I did... Rincewind clutched it guiltily as the guard scurried towards his master's digit. Voice, said Rincewind. Yes. What happens if I claim immunity because I'm a foreigner? There's a special thing they do with a wire mesh waistcoat and a cheese grater. Oh. And there are torturers in Hung Hung who can keep a man alive for years. I suppose you're not talking about healthy early morning runs and a high-fiber diet. No, so keep quiet, and with any luck you'll be sent to be a slave in the palace. Luck is my middle name, said Rincewind, indistinctly. Mind you, my first name is bad. Remember to gibber and grovel. I'll do my very best. The white hand emerged bearing a scrap of paper. The guard took it, turned towards Rincewind, and cleared his throat. Hearken to the wisdom and justice of District Commissioner Key, ball of swamp emanations. Not him, I mean you. He cleared his throat again and peered closer at the paper in the manner of one who learned to read by saying the name of each letter very carefully to himself. The white pony runs through the... the... The guard turned and held a whispered conversation with the curtains and turned back again. Chrysanthemum blossoms. The cold wind stirs the 
apricot trees, send him to the palace to slave until all appendages drop off. Several of the other guards applauded. Look up and clap, said the voice. I'm afraid my appendages will drop off. It's a big cheese grater. Encore! Wow! Superb! That bit about the chrysanthemums! Wonderful! Good. Listen. You're from Bespelagic. You've got the right accent, damned if I know why. It's a seaport, and people there are a little strange. You were robbed by bandits and escaped on one of their horses. That's why you haven't got your papers. You need pieces of paper for everything here, including being anybody. And pretend you don't know me. I don't know you. Good. Long live the changing things to a more equitable state while retaining due respect for the traditions of our forebears and, of course, not harming the august personage of the Emperor Endeavour. Good. Yes. What? A guard kicked Rincewind in the region of the kidneys. This suggested, in the universal language of the boot, that he should get up. He managed to get up on one knee and saw the luggage. It wasn't his, and there were three of them. The luggage trotted to the crest of a low hill and stopped so fast that it left a lot of little grooves in the dirt. In addition to not having any equipment with which to think or feel, the luggage also had no means of seeing. The manner in which it perceived events was a complete mystery. It perceived other luggages. The three of them stood patiently in a line behind the palanquin. They were big. They were black. The luggage's legs disappeared inside its body. After a while, it very cautiously opened its lid, just a fraction. Of the three things that most people know about the horse, the third is that over a short distance, it can't run as fast as a man. As Rincewind had learned to his advantage, it has more legs to sort out. There are additional advantages if, A, the people on horseback aren't expecting you to run, and, B, you happen to be very conveniently in an athletic starting position. Rincewind rose like a boomerang curry from a sensitive stomach. There was a lot of shouting, but the comforting thing, the important thing, was that it was all behind him. It would soon try to catch him up, but that was a problem for the future. He could also consider where he was running to as well, but an experienced coward never bothered with the two when the from held such fascination. A less practiced runner would have risked a glance behind, but Rincewind instinctively knew all about wind drag and the tendency of inconvenient rocks to position themselves under the unwary foot. Besides, why look behind? He was already running as fast as he could. Nothing he could see would make him run any faster. There was a large shapeless village ahead, a construction apparently of mud and dung. In the fields in front of it, a dozen peasants looked up from their toil at the accelerating wizard. Perhaps it was Rincewind's imagination, but as he passed them, he could have sworn that he heard the cry, Necessarily extended duration to the Red Army, regrettable decease without undue suffering to the forces of oppression. Rincewind dived through the huts as the soldiers charged at the peasants. Cohen had been right. There seemed to be a revolution, but the Empire had been in unchanged existence for thousands of years, Courtesy and respect for protocol were part of its very fabric, and by the sound of it, the revolutionaries had yet to master the art of impolite slogans. Rincewind preferred running to hiding. Hiding was all very well, but if you were found, then you were stuck. But the village was the only cover for miles around, and some of the soldiers had horses. A man might be faster than a horse over a short distance, but over this panorama of flat open fields, a horse had a running man banged to rights. So he ducked into a building at random and pushed aside the first door he came to. It had pasted on it the words, Examination. Silence. Forty expectant and slightly worried faces looked up at him from their writing stools. They weren't children, but full-grown adults. There was a lectern at the end of the room, and on it a pile of papers sealed with string and wax. Rincewind felt the atmosphere was familiar. He'd breathed it before, even if it had been a world away. It was full of those cold, sweaty odours created by the sudden realisation that it was probably too late to do that revision you'd kept on putting off. Rincewind had faced many horrors in his time, but none held quite the same place in the lexicon of dread as those few seconds after someone said, Turn over your papers now.
The candidates were watching him. There was shouting somewhere outside. He hurried up to the lectern, tore at the string, and distributed the papers as fast as he could. Then he dived back to the safety of the lectern, removed his hat, and was bent low when the door opened slowly. "'Go away!' he screamed. "'Examination in progress!' The unseen figure behind the door murmured something to someone else. The door was closed again. The candidates were still staring at him. Uh, very well. Turn over your papers. There was a rustle, a few moments of that dreadful silence, and then much activity with brushes. Competitive examinations. Oh, yes. That was another thing people knew about the Empire. They were the only way to get any kind of public post, and the security that brought. People had said that this must be a very good system, because it opened up opportunities for people of merit. Rincewind picked up a spare paper and read it. It was headed, Examination for the Post of Assistant Night Soil Operative for the District of Wung. He read question one. It required candidates to write a sixteen-line poem on evening mist over the reed beds. Question two seemed to be about the use of metaphor in some book Rincewind had never heard of. Then there was a question about music. Rincewind turned the paper over a couple of times. There didn't seem to be any mention anywhere of words like compost or bucket or wheelbarrow, but presumably all this produced a better class of person than the ankh Morpork system, which asks just one question, got your own shovel, have you? The shouting outside seemed to have died away. Rincewind risked poking his head out of the door. There was a commotion near the road, but it no longer seemed rincewind orientated. He ran for it. The students got on with their examination. One of the more enterprising, however, rolled up his trouser leg and copied down a poem about mist he'd composed, at great effort, some time previously. After a while, you got to know what kind of questions the examiners asked. Rincewind trotted onwards, trying to keep to ditches wherever these weren't knee-deep in sucking mud. It wasn't a landscape built for concealment. The Agateans grew crops on any piece of ground the seeds wouldn't roll off. Apart from the occasional rocky outcrop, there was a distinct lack of places in which to lurk. No one paid him much attention once he'd left the village far behind. The occasional water buffalo operative would turn to watch him until he was out of sight, but displayed no special curiosity. It was merely that Rincewind was marginally more interesting than watching a water buffalo defecate. He kept the road just in sight, and by evening reached a crossroads. There was an inn. Rincewind hadn't eaten since the leopard. The inn meant food, but food meant money. He was hungry, and he had no money. He chided himself for this kind of negative thinking. That was not the right approach. What he should do was go in and order a large, nourishing meal. Then, instead of being hungry with no money, he'd be well fed with no money. A net gain on his current position. Of course, the world was likely to raise some objections, but in Rincewind's experience there were few problems that couldn't be solved with a scream and a good ten yards start. And of course, he would have just had a strengthening meal. Besides, he liked Hung Hungy's food. A few refugees had opened restaurants in Ankh Morpork, and Rincewind considered himself something of an expert on the dishes, such as dish of glistening brown stuff, dish of glistening crunchy orange stuff, and dish of soft white lumps. The one huge room was thick with smoke, and insofar as this could be determined through the swirls and coils, quite busy. A couple of old men were sitting in front of a complicated pile of ivory tiles, playing Shibo Yang Kong San. He wasn't sure what they were smoking, but by the looks on their faces, they were happy they'd chosen it. Rincewind made his way to the fireplace where a skinny man was tending a cauldron. He gave him a cheery smile. Good morning. Can I partake of your famous delicacy, meal A for two people with extra prawn cracker? Never heard of it. Um, then could I see a painful ear, a croak of frog, a menu? What's a menu, friend? Rincewind nodded. He knew what it meant when a stranger called you friend like that. No one who called someone else friend was feeling very kindly disposed. Uh, what is there to eat, I meant. Noodles, boiled cabbage, and pork whiskers. Is that all? Pork whiskers don't grow on trees, San. 
I've been seeing water buffalo all day, Rincewind said. Don't you people ever eat beef? The ladle splashed into the cauldron. Somewhere behind him a shibo tile dropped onto the floor. The back of Rincewind's head prickled under the stairs. We don't serve rebels in this place, said the landlord loudly. Probably too meaty, Rincewind thought. But it seemed to him that the words had been addressed to the world in general rather than to him. Glad to hear it, he said, because... Yes, indeed, said the landlord a little louder. No rebels welcome here. Well, that's fine by me, because if I knew of any rebels, I would be certain to alert the authorities, the landlord bellowed. I'm not a rebel, I'm just hungry, said Rincewind. I'd, uh, like a bowlful, please. A bowl was filled. Rainbow patterns shimmered on its oily surface. That'll be half a rhino, said the landlord. You mean you want me to pay before I eat it, said Rincewind. You might not want to afterwards, friend. A rhino was more gold than Rincewind had ever owned. He patted his pockets theatrically. In fact, it seems that, he began, there was a small thump beside him. What I did on my holidays had fallen onto the floor. Yes, thank you, that will do nicely, said the landlord to the room at large. He pushed the bowl into Rincewind's hand, and in one movement scooped up the booklet and crammed it back into the wizard's pocket. Go and sit down in the corner, he hissed, and you'll be told what to do. But I'm sure I know what to do. Dip spoon in bowl, raise spoon to mouth. Sit down. Rincewind found the darkest corner and sat down. People were still watching him. To avoid the group gaze, he pulled out what I did and opened it at random in an effort to find out why it had a magical effect on the landlord. Sold me a bun containing what was called a complicated pictogram made entirely of the inside of pigs, urinating dog, he read and such as these could be bought for small coin at any time, and so replete were the citizens that hardly any bought these, complicated pictogram, from the stall of complicated pictogram, but it seemed to involve a razor, San. Sausages filled with pig parts, thought Rincewind. Well, perhaps they might be amazing if up until then a bowl of dishwater with something congealing on the top of it had been your idea of a hearty meal. Ha! Huh. Mr. What I Did on My Holidays should try coming to Ankh Morpork next time and see how much he liked one of old Dibbler's sausages, full of genuine pig product. The spoon splashed into the bowl. Rincewind turned the pages hurriedly. Peaceful streets along which I walked were quite free of crime and brigandage. Of course they were, you four-eyed little git, shouted Rincewind. That was because it was all happening to me. A city where all men are free... Free? Free? Well, yes, free to starve, get robbed by the thieves' guild, said Rincewind to the book. He fumbled through to another page. My companion was the great wizard. Complicated pictogram, but now that Rincewind studied it, he realized with a plummeting heart it had a few lines that looked like the Agatean for wind. The most prominent and powerful wizard in the entire country. I never said that. I... Rincewind stopped. Memory treacherously dredged up a few phrases such as, Oh, the Arch-Chancellor listens to everything I say, and that place would just fall down without me around. But that was just the sort of thing you said after a few beers. Surely no one would be so gullible as to write. A picture focused itself in Rincewind's memory. It was of a happy, smiling little man with huge spectacles and a trusting, innocent approach to life which brought terror and destruction everywhere he wandered. Two Flower had been quite unable to believe that the world was a bad place, and that was largely because to him it wasn't. It saved it all up for Rincewind. Rincewind's life had been quite uneventful before he'd met Two Flower. Since then, as far as he could remember, it had contained events in huge amounts. And the little man had gone back home, hadn't he, to Best Pelagic the Empire's only proper seaport. Surely no one would be so gullible as to write this sort of thing. 
Surely no one apart from one person would be so gullible. Rincewind was not politically minded, but there were some things he could work out, not because they were to do with politics, but because they had a lot to do with human nature. Nasty images moved into place like bad scenery. The Empire had a wall around it. If you lived in the Empire, then you learned how to make soup out of pig squeals and swallow spit, because that's how it was done. And you were bullied by soldiers all the time, because that was how the world worked. But if someone wrote a cheerful little book about what I did on my holidays, in a place where the world worked quite differently... Then, however fossilized the society, there would always be some people who asked themselves dangerous questions, like, Where's the pork? Rincewind stared glumly at the wall. Peasants of the Empire rebel. You have nothing to lose but your heads and hands and feet, and there's this thing they do with a wire waistcoat and a cheese grater. He turned the book over. There was no author's name. There was simply a little message. Increased luck, make copies, extended duration and happiness to the endeavour. Ankh Morpork had had the occasional rebellion too over the years, but no one went around organising things. They just grabbed themselves a weapon and took to the streets. No one bothered with a formal battle cry, relying instead on the well-tried, There he goes, get him, got him, now kick him in a fork. The point was... Whatever caused that sort of thing wasn't usually the reason for it. When Mad Lord Snape Case had been hung up by his figging, according to the history books. However, in common with every other young student, Rincewind had hopefully looked up figging in the dictionary and found it was a small bun with currants in it. This meant that either the language had changed a little over the years, or that there really was some horrifying aspect to suspending a man alongside a tea cake. It hadn't really been because he'd made poor old Spooner Boggis eat his own nose. It had been because years of inventive nastiness had piled on one another until the grievances reached. There was a terrible scream from the far side of the room. Rincewind was half out of his seat before he noticed the little stage and the actors. A trio of musicians had squatted down on the floor. The inn's customers turned to watch. It was in a way quite enjoyable. Rincewind didn't quite follow the plot, but it went something like man gets girl, man loses girl to other man, man cuts couple in half, man falls on own sword, all come up front for a bow to what might be the Agatean equivalent of happy days are here again. It was a little hard to make out the fine detail because the actors shouted hoorah a lot and spent much of their time talking to the audience and their masks all looked the same to Rincewind. The musicians were in a world of their own, or by the sound of it, three different worlds. Fortune cookie? Hm? Huh? Rincewind re-emerged from the thickets of thespianism to see the landlord beside him. A dish of vaguely bivalvular biscuits was thrust under his nose. Fortune cookie? Rincewind reached out. Just as his fingers were about to close on one, the plate was jerked sideways an inch or two, bringing another under his hand. Oh well, he took it. The thing was, his thoughts resumed as the play screamed on. At least in Ankh Morpork you could lay your hands on real weapons. Poor devils. It took more than well-turned slogans and a lot of enthusiasm to run a good rebellion. You needed well-trained fighters and, above all, a good leader. He hoped they had found one when he was well away. He unrolled the fortune and read it idly, oblivious to the landlord walking around behind him. Instead of the usual, you have just enjoyed an inferior meal, it was quite a complicated pictogram. Rincewind's fingers traced the brush strokes. Many, many apologies. What kind? The musician with the cymbals clashed them together sharply. The wooden kosh bounced off Rincewind's head. The old men playing Shibo nodded happily to themselves and turned back to their game. It was a fine morning. The hideout echoed to the sounds of the silver horde getting up, groaning, adjusting various homemade surgical supports, complaining that they couldn't find their spectacles, and mistakenly gumming one another's dentures. Cohen sat with his feet in a bath of warm water, enjoying the sunshine. Cage? The former geography teacher concentrated on a map he was making. 
Yes, Genghis. What's Mad Hamish going on about? He says the bread's stale and he can't find his teeth. Tell him if things go right for us, he can have a dozen young women just to chew his bread for him, said Cohen. That is not very hygienic, Genghis, said Mr. Savaloy, without bothering to look up. Remember, I explained about hygiene. Cohen didn't bother to answer. He was thinking. Six old men. And you can't really count Teach. He's a thinker, not a fighter. Self-doubt was not something regularly entertained within the Cohen cranium. When you're trying to carry a struggling temple maiden and a sack of looted temple goods in one hand and fight off half a dozen angry priests with the other, there is little time for reflection. Natural selection saw to it that the professional heroes who at a crucial moment tended to ask themselves questions like, what is my purpose in life, very quickly lacked both. But six old men and the Empire had almost a million men under arms. When you looked at the odds in the cold light of dawn, or even this rather pleasant warm light of dawn, they made you stop and do the arithmetic of death. If the plan went wrong... Cohen bit his lip thoughtfully. If the plan went wrong, it'd take weeks to kill all of them. Maybe he should have let old Thog the Butcher come along too, even though he had to stop fighting every ten minutes to go to the lavatory. Oh, well. He was committed now, so he might as well make the best of it. Cohen's father had taken him to a mountaintop when he was no more than a lad and explained to him the hero's creed and told him that there was no greater joy than to die in battle. Cohen had seen the flaw in this straight away, and a lifetime's experience had reinforced his belief that in fact a greater joy was to kill the other bugger in battle and end up sitting on a heap of gold higher than your horse. It was an observation that had served him well. He stood up and stretched in the sunshine. It's a lovely morning, lads, he said. I feel like a million dollars, don't you? There was a murmur of reluctant agreement. Good, said Cohen. Let's go and get some. The Great Wall completely surrounds the Agatean Empire. The word is completely. It is usually about twenty feet high and sheer on its inner side. It is built along beaches and across howling deserts, and even on the lip of sheer cliffs where the possibility of attack from outside is remote. On subject islands like Bang Bang Duk and Tingling, there are similar walls, all metaphorically the same wall, and that seems strange to those of an unthinking military disposition who do not realize what its function really is. It's more than just a wall. It is a marker. On one side is the empire, which in the Agatean language is a word identical with universe, on the other side is nothing. After all, the universe is everything there is. Oh, there may appear to be things like sea, islands, other continents and so on. They may even appear solid. It may be possible to conquer them, walk on them. But they are not ultimately real. The Agatean word for foreigner is the same as the word for ghost, and only one brush stroke away from the word for victim. The walls are sheer in order to discourage those boring people who persist in believing that there might be anything interesting on the other side. Amazingly enough, there are people who simply won't take the hint, even after thousands of years. The ones near the coast build rafts and head out across lonely seas to lands that are a fable. The ones inland resort to man-carrying kites and chairs propelled by fireworks. Many of them die in the attempt, of course. Most of the others are soon caught and made to live in interesting times but some did make it to the great melting pot called Ankh Morpork. They arrived with no money, sailors charged what the market would bear, which was everything, but they had a mad gleam in their eye, and they opened shops and restaurants and worked twenty-four hours a day. People called this the Ankh Morpork dream of making piles of cash in a place where your death was unlikely to be a matter of public policy, and it was dreamed all the stronger by people who didn't sleep. Rincewind sometimes thought that his life was punctuated by awakenings. They were not always rude ones. Sometimes they were merely impolite. A very few, one or two perhaps, had been quite nice, especially on the island. 
The sun had come up in its humdrum fashion, the waves had washed on the beach in quite a boring way, and on several occasions he'd managed to erupt from unconsciousness without his habitual small scream. This one wasn't just rude, it was downright insolent. He was being bumped about and someone had tied his hands together. It was dark, a fact occasioned by the sack over his head. Rincewind did some calculation and reached a conclusion. This is the seventeenth worst day of my life so far, he thought. Being knocked unconscious in pubs was quite commonplace. If it happened in Ark Moorpork, then you'd likely as not wake up lying on the Ark with all your money gone, or if a ship was due out on a long and unpopular voyage, chained up in some scupper somewhere, with no option for the next two years but to plough the ocean wave. A dismal prospect, especially when the horses keep sinking. But generally, the knocker wanted to keep you alive. The thieves' guild were punctilious about that. As they said, hit a man too hard, and you can only rob him once. Hit him just hard enough, and you can rob him every week. If he was in what felt like a cart, then someone had some purpose in keeping him alive. He wished he hadn't thought of that. Someone pulled the sack off. A terrifying visage stared down at him. I would like to eat your foot, said Rincewind. Don't worry, I'm a friend. The mask was lifted away. There was a young woman behind it. round-faced, snub-nosed, and quite different from any other citizen Rincewind had met hitherto. That was, he realized, because she was looking straight at him. Her clothes, if not her face, had last been seen on the stage. Don't cry out, she said. Why? What are you going to do? We would have welcomed you properly, but there was no time. She sat down among the bundles in the back of the swaying cart and regarded him critically. Four big sandals said you arrived on a dragon and slaughtered a regiment of soldiers, she said. I did. And then you worked a magic on a venerable old man, and he became a great fighter. He did. And you gave him whole meat, even though four big sandals is only of the pung class. I did. And you have your hat. Yes, yes, got my hat. And yet, said the girl, you don't look like a great wizard. Ah, well, the fact is, the girl looked as fragile as a flower, but she just pulled out from somewhere in the folds of her costume a small but perfectly serviceable knife. Rincewind had picked up an instinct for this sort of thing. This was probably not the time to deny great wizardry. The fact is, he repeated, that how do I know I can trust you? The girl looked indignant. Do you not have amazing wizardly powers? Oh, yes, certainly, but, um... Say something in wizard language. Um, Sturcus, 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 Moritatus, Sum, said Rincewind, his eye on the knife. Oh, excrement. Am I about to die? It's, um, a special mantra, I say, to raise the magical fluxes. The girl subsided a little. But it takes it out of you, wizarding, said Rincewind, flying on dragons, magically turning old men into warriors. I can only do so much of that sort of thing before it's time for a rest. Right now I'm very weak on account of the tremendous amounts of magic I've just used, you see. She looked at him with doubt still in her eyes. All the peasants believe in the imminent arrival of the great wizard, she said. But in the words of the great philosopher Lee Tin Weedle, When many expect a mighty stallion, they will find hooves on an ant. She gave him another calculating look. When you were on the road, she said, you groveled in front of District Commissioner Key. You could have blasted him with terrible fire. Biding my time, spying out the land, not wanting to break my cover, Rincewind gabbled. Uh, no good revealing myself straight away, is there? You are maintaining a disguise? Yes. It is a very good one. Uh, thank you, because only a great wizard could dare to look like such a pathetic piece of humanity. Thank you. Um, how did you know I was on the road? They would have killed you there and then if I had not told you what to do. You were the guard? 
We had to catch up with you quickly. It was sheer luck you were seen by four big sandal. We? She ignored the question. They are only provincial soldiers. I would not have got away with it in Hong Hong. But I can play many roles. She put away the knife, but Rincewind had a feeling that he hadn't talked her into believing him, only into not killing him. He groped for a straw. I've got a magic box on legs, he said, with a touch of pride. It follows me around. It seems to have got itself mislaid right now, but it's quite an amazing thing. The girl gave him a wooden look. Then she reached down with a delicate hand and hauled him upright. Is it, she said, something like this? She twitched aside the curtains at the rear of the cart. Two boxes were trundling along in the dust. They were more battered and cheaper looking than the luggage, but recognizably the same general species, if you could apply the word to travel accessories. Um, yes. She let go. Rincewind's head hit the floor. Listen to me, she said. A lot of bad things are happening. I don't believe in great wizards, but other people do, and sometimes people need something to believe in. And if these other people die because we've got a wizard who is not so very great, then he will be a very unlucky wizard indeed. You may be the great wizard. If you are not, then I suggest you study very hard to be great. Do I make myself clear? Um, yes. Rincewind had been faced with death on numerous occasions. Often there was armor and swords involved. This occasion just involved a pretty girl and a knife. But somehow managed to be among the worst. She sat back. We are a traveling theater, she said. It is convenient. No actors are allowed to move around. Aren't they? said Rincewind. You do not understand. We are no actors. Oh, you weren't too bad. Great wizard, no is a non-realist symbolic form of theatre employing archaic language, stylized gestures and an accompaniment of flutes and drums. Your pretense of stupidity is masterly, so much so that I could even believe that you are no actor. Excuse me, what is your name? Rincewind said. Pretty Butterfly. Um, yes? She glared at him and slipped away towards the front of the cart. It rumbled on. Rincewind lay with his head in a sack smelling of onions and methodically cursed things. He cursed women with knives, and history generally, and the entire faculty of Unseen University, and his absent luggage, and the population of the Agatean Empire. But right now, at the top of the list, was whoever had designed this cart. By the feel of it, Whoever had thought that rough, splintery wood was the right surface for a floor was also the person who thought triangular was a nice shape for a wheel. The luggage lurked in a ditch, watched without much interest by a man holding a water buffalo on the end of a piece of string. It was feeling ashamed and baffled and lost. It was lost because everywhere around it was familiar. The light, the smells, the feel of the soil but it didn't feel owned. It was made of wood. Wood is sensitive to these things. One of its many feet idly traced an outline in the mud. It was a random, wretched pattern, familiar to anyone who's had to stand in front of the class and be scolded. Finally, it reached something that was probably as close as timber can get to a decision. It had been given away. It had spent many years trailing through strange lands, meeting exotic creatures and jumping up and down on them. Now it was back in the country where it had once been a tree. Therefore, it was free. It was not the most logical chain of thought, but pretty good when all you've got to think with are knot holes. And there was something it very much wanted to do. When you're ready, teach. Sorry, Genghis, I'm just finishing. Cohen sighed. The horde were taking advantage of the rest to sit in the shade of a tree and tell one another lies about their exploits, while Mr. Saveloy stood on top of a boulder, squinting through some kind of homemade device and doodling on his maps. Bits of paper ruled the world now, Cohen told himself. It certainly ruled this part of it. And Teach, well, Teach ruled bits of paper. He might not be traditional barbarian hero material, despite his deeply held belief that all headmasters should be riveted to a cowshed door, 
but the man was amazing with bits of paper. And he could speak Agatean. Well, speak it better than Cohen, who'd picked it up in a rough and ready way. He said he'd learnt it out of some old book. He said it was amazing how much interesting stuff was in old books. Cohen struggled up alongside him. What exactly are you planning, teach? he said. Mr. Savaloy squinted at Hung Hung, just visible on the dusty horizon. Do you see that hill behind the city? he said. The huge round mound. It looks like my dad's burial mound to me, said Cohen. No, it must be a natural formation. It's far too big. There's some kind of pagoda on top, I see. Interesting. Perhaps later I shall take a closer look. Cohen peered at the big round hill. It was a big round hill. It wasn't threatening him, and it didn't look valuable. End of saga, as far as he was concerned. There were more pressing matters. People appear to be entering and leaving the outer city, Mr. Savaloy continued. The siege is more a threat than a reality, so getting inside should not be a problem. Of course, getting into the forbidden city itself will be a lot more difficult. How about if we kill everyone, said Cohen. A good idea, but impractical, said Mr. Savaloy, and liable to cause comment. No. My current methodology is predicated on the fact that Hung Hung is some considerable way from the river, yet has almost a million inhabitants. Predicated, yeah, said Cohen. And the local geography is, is quite wrong for artesian wells. Yeah, that's what I thought. And yet there is no visible aqueduct, you notice. No aqueduct, right, said Cohen. Probably flown to the rim for the summer. Some birds do that. Which rather leads me to doubt the saying that not even a mouse can get into the Forbidden City, said Mr. Savaloy, with just a trace of smugness. I suspect a mouse could get into the Forbidden City if it could hold its breath. Or ride on one of them invisible ducks, said Cohen. Indeed. The cart stopped. The sack came off. Instead of the cheese grater Rincewind was secretly expecting, the view consisted of a couple of young, concerned faces. One of them was female, but Rincewind was relieved to see that she wasn't Pretty Butterfly. This one looked younger, and made Rincewind think a little of potatoes. When you're on a desert island, your appetites can become a bit confused. How you are, she said in a fractured but recognisable Morporkian. We are very sorry. All better now? We speak you in language of Celestial City of Ankh Mor Pork. Language of freedom and progress. Language of one man, one vote. Yes, said Rincewind. A vision of Ankh Mor Pork's patrician floated across his memory. One man, one vote. Yes, I've met him. He's definitely got the vote. But. Extra luck to the people's endeavour. Said the boy, advanced judiciously. He looked as though he'd been built with bricks. Excuse me, said Rincewind, but why did you, uh, a paper lantern for ceremonial purposes, uh, bale of cotton, uh, rescue me? Uh, that is, when I say rescue, I suppose I mean, why did you hit me on the head, tie me up, and bring me to wherever this is? because the worst that could have happened to me in the inn was a ding round the ear for not paying for lunch. The worst that would have happened was an agonising death over several years, said the voice of Butterfly. She appeared round the cart and smiled grimly at Rincewind. Her hands were tucked demurely in her kimono, presumably to hide the knives. Oh, hello, he said. Great wizard, said Butterfly, bowing. I you already know. But these two are Lotus Blossom and three yoked oxen, other members of our cadre. We had to bring you here like this. There are spies everywhere. Timely demise to all enemies, said the boy, beaming. Good, yes, right, said Rincewind. All enemies, yes. The cart was in a courtyard. The general noise level on the other side of the very high walls suggested a large city. Nasty. Certainly crystallised. 
and you've brought me to Hung Hung, haven't you? He said. Lotus Blossom's eyes widened. Then it are true, she said in Rincewind's own language. You are the great wizard. Oh, you'd be amazed at the things I can foresee," said Rincewind despondently. "You two go and stable the horses," said Butterfly, not taking her eyes off Rincewind. When they'd hurried away with several backward glances, she walked up to him. "They believe," she said. "Personally, I have my doubts, but Lee Tin Weedle says an ass may do the work of an ox in time of no horses. One of his less convincing aphorisms, I always thought." "Thank you." What is a cadre? Have you heard of the Red Army? No. Well, I heard someone shout something. According to legend, an unknown person known only as the Great Wizard led the first Red Army to an impossible victory. Of course, that was thousands of years ago, but the people believe that he, that is, you, will return to do it again. So. There should be a red army ready and waiting. Well, of course, a man can get a little stiff after several thousand years. Her face was suddenly level with his own. Personally, I suspect there has been a misunderstanding. She hissed. But now you're here, you'll be a great wizard. If I have to prod you every step of the way. The other two returned. Butterfly went from snarling tiger to demure doe in an instant. And now you must come and meet the Red Army," she said. "Won't they be a little smelly?" Rincewind began, and stopped when he saw her expression. "The original Red Army was clearly only a legend," she said, in fast and faultless Ankh Morporkian. "But legends have their uses. You'd better know the legend, Great Wizard." When one sun mirror was fighting all the armies of the world, the great wizard came to his aid, and the earth itself rose up and fought for the new empire. And lightning was involved. The army was made from the earth, but in some way driven by the lightning. Now lightning may kill, but I suspect it lacks discipline, and earth cannot fight. But no doubt our army of the earth and sky was nothing more nor less than an uprising of the peasants themselves. Well, now we have a new army and a name that fires the imagination, and a great wizard. I don't believe in legends, but I believe that other people believe. The younger girl, who had been trying to follow this, stepped forward and gripped his arm. "You're coming, seeing red army now," she said. "Forward motion with masses," said the boy, taking Rincewind's other arm. "Does he always talk like that?" said Rincewind, as he was propelled gently towards the door. Three yoked oxen does not study," said the girl. "Extra success attend our leaders." Tuppence a bucket, well stamped down," said Rincewind encouragingly. "Much ownership of means of production. How's your granny off for soap?" Three yoked oxen beamed. Butterfly opened the door. That left Rincewind outside with the other two. Very useful slogans," he said, moving sideways just a little. "But I would draw your attention to the famous saying of the great wizard Rincewind." "Indeed, I am all ear," said Lotus Blossom politely. "Rincewind," he say, "Good bye." His sandals skidded on the cobbles, but he was already travelling fast when he hit the doors, which turned out to be made of bamboo and smashed apart easily. There was a street market on the other side. That was something Rincewind remembered later about Hung Hung. As soon as there was a space, any kind of space, even a space created by the passage of a cart or a mule, people flowed into it, usually arguing with one another at the tops of their voices over the price of a duck which was being held upside down and quacking. His foot went through a wicker cage containing several chickens, but he pressed on, scattering people and produce. In an Ankh Morpork street market, something like this would have caused some comment. But since everyone around him already seemed to be screaming into other people's faces, Rincewind was merely a momentary and unremarked nuisance as he half ran, half limped with one squawking foot past the stalls. Behind him, the people flowed back. There may have been some cries of pursuit, but they were lost in the hubbub. He didn't stop until he found an overlooked alcove between a stall selling songbirds and another purveying something that bubbled in bowls. His foot crowed. 
He smashed it against cobbles until the cage broke. The cockerel, maddened by the heady air of freedom, pecked him on the knee and fluttered away. There were no sounds of pursuit. However, a battalion of trolls in tin boots would have had trouble making themselves heard above a normal hung-hung street market. He let himself get his breath back. Well, he was his own man again. So much for the Red Army. Admittedly, he was in the capital city where he didn't want to be, and it was only a matter of time before something else unpleasant happened to him, but it wasn't actually happening at the moment. Let him find his bearings and five minutes start and they could watch his dust, or mud, and there was a lot of both here. So, this was Hung Hung. There didn't seem to be streets in the sense Rincewind understood the term. Alleys opened onto alleys, all of them narrow and made narrower by the stalls that lined them. There was a large animal population in the marketplace. Most of the stalls had their share of caged chickens, ducks in sacks, and strange wriggling things in bowls. From one stall, a tortoise on top of a struggling heap of other tortoises under a sign saying, Three R each, good for ying, gave Rincewind a slow, You think you've got troubles look. But it was hard to tell where the stalls ended and the buildings began in any case. Dried-up things hanging on a string might be merchandise or someone's washing or quite possibly next week's dinner. The hung hung were an outdoor kind of people. From the look of it, they conducted most of their lives on the street and at the top of their voice. Progress was made by viciously elbowing and shoving people until they got out of the way. Standing still and saying, uh, excuse me, was a recipe for immobility. The crowds did part, though, at the banging of a gong and a succession of loud pops. A group of people in white robes danced past, throwing fireworks around and banging on gongs, saucepans, and odd bits of metal. The din contrived to be louder than the street noise, but only by very great effort. Rincewind had been getting the occasional puzzled glance from people who stopped screaming long enough to notice him. Perhaps it was time to act like a native. He turned to the nearest person and screamed, Pretty good, eh? The person, a little old lady in a straw hat, stared at him in distaste. It's Mr. Wu's funeral, she snapped and walked off. There were a couple of soldiers nearby. If this had been Ankh Morpork, then they'd have been sharing a cigarette and trying not to see anything that might upset them. But these had an alert look. Rincewind backed into another alley. An untutored visitor could clearly find himself in big trouble here. This alley was quieter, and at the far end opened into something much wider and empty-looking. On the basis that people also meant trouble, Rincewind headed in that direction. Here at last was an open space. It was very open indeed. It was a paved square, big enough to hold a couple of armies. It had cherry trees growing along the verges, and given the heaving mob everywhere else, a surprising absence of anyone. You! Apart from the soldiers. They appeared abruptly from behind every tree and statue. Rincewind tried to back away, but that proved unfortunate since there was a guard behind him. A terrifying armoured mask confronted him. Peasant, do you not know this is the Imperial Square? Was that a capital S on square, please? said Rincewind. You do not ask questions. Ah, I'll take that as a yes. So it's important then. Sorry, I'll just sort of, um... Go away, then. You stay. But what struck Rincewind as amazingly odd was that none of them actually took hold of him. And then he realized that this must be because they hardly ever needed to. People did what they were told. There's something worse than whips in the Empire, Cohen had said. At this point, he realized he should be on his knees. He crouched down, hands placed lightly in front of him. I wonder, he said brightly, rising into the starting position, if this is the time to draw your attention to a famous saying. Cohen was familiar with city gates. He'd broken down a number in his time by battering ram, siege gun, and on one occasion with his head. But the gates of Hung Hung were pretty damn good gates. They weren't like the gates of Ankh Morpork, which were usually wide open to attract the spending customer, and whose concession to defence was the sign, Thank you for not attacking our city, Bonum Diem. These were big and made of metal, and there was a guard house and a squad of unhelpful men in black armour. Teach? 
Yes, Cohen? Why are we doing this? I thought we were going to use the invisible duck the mice use. Mr. Savaloy waggled a finger. That's for the Forbidden City itself. I hope we'll find that inside. Now, remember your lessons, he said. It's important that you all learn how to behave in cities. I know how to bloody well behave in cities, said Truckle the Uncivil. Pillage, ravage, loot, set fire to the damn place on your way out, just like towns, only it takes longer. That's all very well if you're just passing through, said Mr. Savaloy, but what if you want to come back the next day? It ain't bloody well there next day, mister. Gentlemen, bear with me. You will have to learn the ways of civilization. People couldn't just walk through. There was a line, and the guards gathered rather offensively around each cowering visitor to examine their papers. And then it was Cohen's turn. Papers, old man. Cohen nodded happily and handed the guard captain a piece of paper on which was written in Mr. Savaloy's best handwriting. We are wandering madmen who have no papers. Sorry. The guard's gaze lifted from the paper and met Cohen's cheerful grin. Indeed, he said nastily. Can't you speak, grandfather? Cohen, still grinning, looked questioningly at Mr. Savaloy. They hadn't rehearsed this part. Foolish dummy, said the guard. Mr. Savaloy looked outraged. I thought you were supposed to show special consideration for the insane, he said. You cannot be insane without papers to say you're insane, said the guard. Oh, I'm fed up with this, said Cohen. I said it wouldn't work if we came across a thick guard. Insolent peasant. I'm not as insolent as my friends here, said Cohen. The horde nodded. That's us, Flatfoot. Bum to you. What? Extremely foolish soldier. What? The captain was taken aback. Deeply ingrained in the Agatean psyche was the habit of obedience. But even stronger was a veneration of one's ancestors and a respect for the elderly and the captain had never seen anyone so elderly while still vertical. They practically were ancestors. The one in the wheelchair certainly smelled like one. Take them to the guardhouse, he shouted. The horde let themselves be manhandled and did it quite well. Mr. Savaloy had spent hours training them in this, since he knew he was dealing with men whose response to a tap on the shoulder was to turn around and hack off someone's arm. It was crowded in the guardhouse with the horde and the guards, and with Mad Hamish's wheelchair. One of the guards looked down at Hamish, glowering under his blanket. What do you have there, grandfather? A sword came up through the cloth and stabbed the guard in the thigh. What? What? What's he see? He said, Arg, Hamish, said Cohen, a knife appearing in his hand. With one movement, his skinny arms had the captain in a lock, the knife at his throat. What? He said, Arg. What? I ain't even married. Cohen put a little more pressure on the captain's neck. Now then, friend, he said, you can have it the easy way, see? Or the hard way. It's up to you. Blood-sucking pig! You call this the easy way? Well, I ain't sweating. May you live in interesting times. I would rather die than betray my emperor. Fair enough. It took the captain only a fraction of a second to realize that Cohen, being a man of his word, assumed that other people were too. He might, if he had had time, have reflected that the purpose of civilization is to make violence the final resort, while to a barbarian it is the first, preferred, only, and above all, most enjoyable option. But by then it was too late. He slumped forward. I always live in interesting times, said Cohen, in the satisfied voice of someone who did a lot to keep them interesting. He pointed his knife at the other guards. Mr. Savaloy's mouth was wide open in horror. By rights, I should be cleaning this, said Cohen, but I ain't going to bother if it's only going to get dirty again. Now, personally, I'd as soon kill you as look at you, but teach here says I've got to stop doing that and become respectable. 
One of the guards looked sideways at his fellows and then fell on his knees. What is your wish, O、oh、master? he said. Ah, officer material, said Cohen. What's your name, lad? Nine orange trees, master. Cohen looked at Mr. Savaloy. What do I do now? Take them prisoner, please. How do I do that? Well, I, I suppose you tie them up, that sort of thing. Ah, and then cut their throats. No, no, you see, once you've got them at your mercy, you're not allowed to kill them. The silver horde, to a man, stared at the ex-teacher. I'm afraid that's civilization for you, he added. But you said the sods haven't got any bloody weapons," said Truckle. "Yes," said Mr. Savaloy, shuddering a little. "That's why you're not allowed to kill them." "Are you mad? Got mad papers, have you?" Cohen scratched his stubbly chin. The remainder of the guard watched him in trepidation. They were used to cruel and unusual punishment, but they were unaccustomed to argument first. "You haven't had a lot of military experience, have you, Teach?" he said. Apart from Form Four, not a lot, but I'm afraid this is the way it has to be done. I'm sorry, you did say you wanted me. Well, I vote we just cut their throats right now," said Boy Willie. "I can't be having with this prisoner business either. I mean, who's going to feed them? I'm afraid you have to. Who me?" Not likely. I vote we make them eat their own eyeballs. Ends up all in favour. There was a chorus of assent from the horde, and among the raised hands, Cohen noticed one belonging to Nine Orange Trees. "What are you voting for, lad?" he said. "Please, sir, I would like to go to the lavatory." "You listen to me, you lot." Said Cohen, "This slaughtering and butchering business isn't how you do it these days, right? And that's what Mr. Savaloy says, and he knows how to spell words like marmalade, which is more than you do. Now we know why we're here, and we'd better start as we mean to go on." "Yeah, but you just killed that guard," said Truckle. "I'm breaking myself in," said Cohen. "You've got to creep up on civilization a bit at a time." I still say we should cut their heads off. That's what I did to the mad demon-sucking priests of E. The kneeling guard had cautiously raised his hands again. Please, master. Yes, lad. You could lock us up in that cell over there. Then we wouldn't be any trouble to anyone. Good thinking," said Cohen. "Good lad. The boy keeps his head in a crisis. Lock him up." Thirty seconds later, the horde had limped off into the city. The guards sat in the cramped hot cell. Eventually, one said, "What were they?" "I think they might have been ancestors." "I thought you had to be dead to be an ancestor." "The one in the wheelchair looked dead, right up to the point where he stabbed four white fox." "Should we shout for help? They might hear us." Yes, but if we don't get let out, we'll be stuck in here, and the walls are very thick, and the door is very strong. Good. Rincewind stopped running in some alley somewhere. He hadn't bothered to see if they'd followed him. It was true. Here, with one mighty bound, you could be free, provided you realised it was one of your options. Freedom did, of course, include man's age-old right to starve to death. It seemed a long time since his last proper meal. The voice erupted further down the alley, as if on cue. Rice cakes, rice cakes, get your nice rice cakes. Tea, hundred-year-old eggs, eggs, get them while they're nice and vintage. Get your yeah, what is it? An elderly man had approached the salesman. Dibala Shan, this egg you sold me. What about it, venerable squire? Would you care to smell it? The street vendor took a sniff. Ah, yes, lovely, he said. Lovely, lovely. This egg, said the customer. This egg is practically fresh. Hundred years old if it's a day, Shogun, said the vendor happily. Look at the colour of that shell, nice and black. 
It rubs off. Rincewind listened. There was, he thought, probably something in the idea that there were only a few people in the world. There were lots of bodies, but only a few people. That's why you kept running into the same ones. There was probably some mole somewhere. You saying my produce is fresh? May I disembowel myself honourably? Look, I'll tell you what I'll do. Yes, there seemed to be something familiar and magical about that trader. Someone had come to complain about a fresh egg, and yet within a couple of minutes he'd somehow been talked into forgetting this and purchasing two rice cakes and something strange wrapped in leaves. The rice cakes looked nice. Well, nicer than the other things. Rincewind sidled over. The trader was idly jigging from one foot to the other and whistling under his breath, but he stopped and gave Rincewind a big, honest, friendly grin. Nice ancient egg, Shogun. The bowl in the middle of the tray was full of gold coins. Rincewind's heart sank. The price of one of Mr. Dibala's foul eggs would have bought a street in Ankh Morpork. I suppose you don't give uh, credit, he suggested. Dibala gave him a look. I'll pretend I never heard that, Shogun, he said. Tell me, said Rincewind, do you know if you have any relatives overseas? This got him another look, a sideways one, full of sudden appraisal. What? There's nothing but evil blood-sucking ghosts beyond the seas. Everyone knows that, Shogun. I'm surprised you don't. Ghosts, said Rincewind. Trying to get here, do us harm, said Disembowel myself honorably. Maybe even steal our merchandise. Give them a dose of the old firecracker, that's what I say. They don't like a good loud bang, ghosts. He gave Rincewind another look, even longer and more calculating. Where are you from, Shogun? he asked, and his voice suddenly had a little barbed edge of suspicion. Bespologic, said Rincewind quickly. That explains my strange accent and mannerisms that might otherwise lead people to think I was some sort of foreigner, he added. Oh, Bespologic, said Disembowel myself honorably. Well, in that case, I expect you know my old friend Five Tongs, who lives in the Street of Heavens, yes? Rincewind was ready for this old trick. No, he said, never heard of him, never heard of the street. Disembowel myself honorably, Dybala grinned happily. If I yell foreign devil loud enough, you won't get three steps, he said in conversational tones. The guards will drag you off to the Forbidden City where there's this special thing they do with... I've heard about it, said Rincewind. Five Tongs has been the district commissioner for three years, and the Street of Heavens is the main street, said so Disembowel myself honorably. I've always wanted to meet a blood-sucking foreign ghost. Have a rice cake. Rincewind's gaze darted this way and that, but strangely enough the situation didn't seem dangerous, or at least inevitably dangerous. It seemed that danger was negotiable. Supposing I was to admit... I was from behind the wall, he said, keeping his voice as low as possible. Dybala nodded. One hand reached into his robe and in a quick movement revealed and then concealed the corner of something which Rincewind was not entirely surprised to see was entitled, What I Did. Some people say that beyond the wall there's nothing but deserts and burning wastes and evil ghosts and terrible monsters, said Dybala. But I say, what about the merchandising opportunities? A man with the right contacts. Know what I mean, Shogun? He could go a long way in the land of blood-sucking ghosts. Rincewind nodded. He didn't like to point out that if you turned up in Ankh Morpork with a handful of gold, then about three hundred people would turn up with a handful of steel. The way I see it, what with all this uncertainty about the Emperor, and talk of rebels and that, long live His Excellency the Son of Heaven, of course, there might just be a niche for the open-minded trader. Am I right? Niche? Niche. Like, we've got this stuff. He leaned closer. Comes out of a caterpillar's unidentified pictogram. It's called silk. It's... Yes, I know. We get it from Clatch, said Rincewind. Oh, well, there's this bush, you see. You dry the leaves, but then you put it in hot water, and you drink... Yes, tea, said Rincewind. That comes from Hawandaland. D. M. H. Dibala looked taken aback. Well, we've got this powder. You put it in tubes. 
Fireworks. Got fireworks. How about this really fine china? It's in Ark Moorpork. We've got dwarfs that can make china you can read a book through, said Rincewind, even if it's got tiny footnotes in it. Dybala frowned. Sounds like you are very clever blood-sucking ghosts, he said, backing away. Maybe it's true that you are dangerous. Us? Don't worry about us, said Rincewind. We hardly ever kill foreigners in Ark Moorpork. It makes it so hard to sell them things afterwards. What have we got you want, though? Go on, have a rice cake. On the pagoda. Want to try some pork balls? On a chopstick? Rincewind selected a cake. He didn't like to ask about the other stuff. You've got gold, he said. Oh, gold, it's too soft to do much with, said Dybala. It's all right for pipes and putting on roofs, though. Oh, I dare say people in Ark Moorpork could find a use for some, said Rincewind. His gaze returned to the coins in Dybala's tray. A land where gold was as cheap as lead. What's that? he said, pointing to a crumpled rectangle half covered with coins. D.M.H. Dybala looked down. It's this thing we have here, he said, speaking slowly. Of course, it's probably all new to you. It's called Mani. It's a way of carrying around your... I meant the bit of paper, said Rincewind. So did I, said Dybala. That's a ten Rhinu note. What does that mean, said Rincewind. Means what it says, said Dybala. Means it's worth ten of these. He held up a gold coin about the size of a rice cake. Why do you want to buy a piece of paper, said Rincewind. You don't buy it. It's for buying things with, said Dybala. Rincewind looked blank. You go to a market stall, said Dybala, getting back into the slow voice for the hard of thinking, and you say, Good morning, butcher. How much for those dog noses? And he says, Three rhino, Shogun. And you say, I've only got a pony, okay? Look, there's an etching of a pony on it, see? That's what you get on a ten rhino note. And he gives you the dog noses and seven coins in what we call change. Now, if you had a monkey, that's fifty rhino. He'd say, got anything smaller? And, but it's only a bit of paper, Rincewind wailed. It may be a bit of paper to you, but it's ten rice cakes to me, said Dybala. What do you foreign bloodsuckers use? Big stones with holes in them? Rincewind stared at the paper money. There were dozens of paper mills in Ark Moorpork, and some of the craftsmen in the Engravers Guild could engrave their names and addresses on a pinhead. He suddenly felt immensely proud of his countrymen. They might be venal and greedy, but by heaven they were good at it, and they never assumed that there wasn't any more to learn. I think you'll find, he said, that there's a lot of buildings in Ark Moorpork that need new roofs. Really? said Dybala. Oh, yes, the rain's just pouring in. And people can pay? Only I heard... Rincewind looked at the paper money again. He shook his head. Worth more than gold. They'll pay with notes at least as good as that, he said. Probably even better. I'll put in a good word for you. And now, he added hurriedly, which way is out? Dybala scratched his head. Could be a bit tricky, he said. There's armies outside. You look a bit foreign with that hat. Could be tricky. There was a commotion further along the alley, or rather a general increase in the commotion. The crowd parted in that hurried way common to unarmed crowds in the presence of weaponry, and a group of guards hurried towards disembowel myself honourably. He stepped back and gave them the friendly grin of one happy to sell at a discount to anyone with a knife. A limp figure was being dragged between two of the guards. As it went past, it raised a slightly blood-stained head and said, Extended duration to the... Before a gloved fist smacked across its mouth. And then the guards were heading down the street. The crowd flowed back. <coughs> said DMH. Seems to be... Hello, where'd you go to? Rincewind reappeared from around a corner. DMH looked impressed. There had actually been a small thunderclap when Rincewind moved. See, they got another of them, he said. Putting up wall posters again, I expect. 
Another one of who? said Rincewind. Red Army. <laughs> oh. I don't pay much attention, said DMH. They say some old legend's going to come true about emperors and stuff. Can't see it myself. He didn't look very legendary, said Rincewind. Ah, some people will believe anything. What'll happen to him? Difficult to say with the emperor about to die. Hands and feet cut off, probably. What? Why? Because he's young. That's leniency. A bit older and it's his head on a spike over one of the gates. That's punishment for putting up a poster. Stops and doing it again, see, said DMH. Rincewind backed away. Thank you, he said, and hurried off. Oh, no, he said, pushing his way through the crowds. I'm not getting mixed up in people's heads being chopped off. And then someone hit him again, but politely. As he sank to his knees and then to his chin, he wondered what had happened to the good old-fashioned, Hey, you. The silver horde wandered through the alleys of Hung Hung. I don't call this bloody world sweeping through a city, slaughtering every bugger, muttered Truckle. When I was riding with Bruce the Hoon, we never walked in through a front gate like a bunch of soppy mother. Mr. Uncivil said Mr. Savaloy hurriedly. I wonder if this might be a good time to refer you to that list I drew up for you. What bloody list, said Truckle, sticking out his jaw belligerently. The list of acceptable civilised words, yes? He turned to the others. Remember I was telling you about civilised behaviour? Civilised behaviour is vital to our long-term strategy. What's a long-term strategy? said Caleb the Ripper. It's what we're going to do later, said Cohen. And what's that then? It's the plan, said Cohen. Well, I'll be... F Truckle began. The list, Mr. Uncivil. Only the words on the list, snapped Mr. Savaloy. Listen, I bow to your expertise when it comes to crossing wildernesses, but this is civilization, and you must use the right words. Please. Better do what he says, Truckle, said Cohen. With bad grace, Truckle fished a grubby piece of paper out of his pocket, then unfolded it. Dang, he said. What's that mean? And what's this darn and heck? They are civilised swear words, said Mr. Savaloy. Well, you can take them and... Ah, said Mr. Savaloy, raising a cautionary finger. You can shove them up. Uh-huh. You can... Huh? Truckle shut his eyes and clenched his fist. Dang it all to heck, he shouted. Good, said Mr. Savaloy. That's much better. He turned to Cohen, who was grinning happily at Truckle's discomfort. Cohen, he said, there's an apple stall over there. Do you fancy an apple? Yeah, might do, Cohen conceded, in the cautious manner of someone giving a conjurer his watch while remaining aware that the man is grinning and holding a hammer. Right. Now then, cl I mean, gentlemen, Genghis wants an apple. There's a stall over there selling fruit and nuts. What does he do? Mr. Savaloy looked hopefully at his charges. Anyone? Yes? Easy. You kill that little... There was a rustle of unfolding paper again. Chap behind the stall. Then... No, Mr. Uncivil. Anyone else? What? You set fire to... No, Mr. Vincent. Anyone else? You rape... No, no, Mr. Ripper, said Mr. Savaloy. We take out some... Mu mu he looked at them expectantly. Money, chorused the horde. And we, what do we do? Now we've gone through this hundreds of times, we... This was the difficult bit. The horde's lined faces creased and puckered still further as they tried to force their minds out of the chasms of habit. Gee, said Cohen hesitantly. Mr. Savaloy gave him a big smile and a nod of encouragement. Give it to... Cohen's lips tensed around the word him. Yes, well done. In 
exchange for the apple. We'll talk about making change and saying thank you later on when you're ready for it. Now then, Cohen, here's the coin. Off you go. Cohen wiped his forehead. He was beginning to sweat. How about if I just cut him up a bit? No, this is civilization. Cohen nodded uncomfortably. He threw back his shoulders and walked over to the stall where the apple merchant, who had been eyeing the group suspiciously, nodded at him. Cohen's eyes glazed and his lips moved silently as if he were rehearsing a script. Then he said, "Ho, fat merchant, give me all your one apple, and I will give you this coin." He looked around. Mr. Savaloy had his thumbs up. You want an apple? Is that it? Said the apple merchant. Yes. The apple merchant selected one. Cohen's sword had been hidden in the wheelchair again, but the merchant, in response to some buried acknowledgment, made sure it was a good apple. Then he took the coin. This proved a little difficult since his customer seemed loath to let go of it. Come on, hand it over, venerable one," he said. Seven crowded seconds passed. Then, when they were safely around the corner, Mr. Savaloy said, "Now, everyone, who can tell me what Genghis did wrong?" Didn't say please. What? Said Mad Hamish. No. Didn't say thank you. What? No. Hit the man over the head with a melon and thumped him into the strawberries and kicked him in the nuts and set fire to his stall and stole all the money. What? Correct. Mr. Savaloy sighed. Genghis, you were doing so well up till then. He didn't ought to have called me what he did. But venerable means old and wise, Genghis. Oh, does it? Yes. Well, I did leave him the money for the apple. Yes, but you see, I do believe you took all his other money. But I paid for the apple," said Cohen rather testily. Mr. Savaloy sighed. Genghis, I do rather get the impression that several thousand years of the patient development of fiscal propriety have somewhat passed you by. Come again? It is possible sometimes for money to legitimately belong to other people," said Mr. Savaloy patiently. The horde paused to wrap their minds around this too. It was, of course, something they knew to be true in theory. Merchants always had money, but it seemed wrong to think of it as belonging to them. It belonged to whoever took it off them. Merchants didn't actually own it; they were just looking after it until it was needed. Now there is an elderly lady over there selling ducks. Said Mrs. Avaloy. I think the next stage,、uh, Mr. Willie, I am not over there. I am sure whatever you are looking at is very interesting, but please pay attention. Is to practice our grasp of social intercourse. <laughs> said Caleb the Ripper. I mean, Mr. Ripper, that you should go and inquire how much it would be for a duck. Said Mr. Avaloy. <laughs> What? And you are not to rip all her clothes off. That's not civilized. Caleb scratched his head. Flakes fell out. Well, what else am I supposed to do? Um, engage her in conversation. Hey, what's there to talk about with a woman? Mr. Savaloy hesitated again. To some extent, this was unknown territory to him as well. His experience with women at his last school had been limited to an occasional chat with the housekeeper, and on one occasion the matron had let him put his hand on her knee. He had been forty before he found out that oral sex didn't mean talking about it. Women had always been to him strange and distant and wonderful creatures, rather than, as the horde to a man believed, something to do. He was struggling a little. The weather, he hazarded. His memory threw in vague recollections of the staple conversation of the maiden aunt who had brought him up. Her health, the trouble with young people today, and then I rip her clothes off. Possibly, 
eventually, if, if she wants you to, I might draw your attention to the discussion we had the other day about taking regular baths, or even a bath, he added to himself, and attention to fingernails and hair and, and changing your clothes more often. This is leather, said Caleb. You don't have to change it. It don't rot for years. Once again, Mr. Savaloy readjusted his sights. He'd thought that civilization could be overlaid on the hoard like a veneer. He had been mistaken. But the funny thing, he mused, as the horde watched Caleb's painful attempts at conversation with a representative of half the world's humanity, was that although they were as far away as possible from the kind of people he normally mixed with in staff rooms, or possibly because they were as far away as possible from the kind of people he normally mixed with in staff rooms, he actually liked them. Every one of them saw a book as either a lavatorial accessory or a set of portable firelighters, and thought that hygiene was a greeting. Yet they were honest from their specialised point of view, and decent from their specialised point of view, and saw the world as hugely simple. They stole from rich merchants and temples and kings. They didn't steal from poor people. This was not because there was anything virtuous about poor people, it was simply because poor people had no money. And although they didn't set out to give money away to the poor, that was nevertheless what they did, if you accepted that the poor consisted of innkeepers, ladies of negotiable virtue, pickpockets, gamblers, and general hangers-on. Because although they would go to great lengths to steal money, they then had as much control over it as a man trying to herd cats. It was there to be spent and lost. So they kept the money in circulation, always a praiseworthy thing in any society. They never worried about what other people thought. Mr. Savaloy, who'd spent his whole life worrying about what other people thought, and had been passed over for promotion and generally treated as a piece of furniture as a result, found this strangely attractive. And they never agonised about anything, or wondered if they were doing the right thing. And they enjoyed themselves immensely. They had a kind of honour. He liked the horde. They weren't his kind of people. Caleb returned, looking unusually thoughtful. "'Congratulations, Mr. Ripper,' said Mr. Savaloy, a great believer in positive reinforcement. "'She still appears to be fully clothed.' "'Yeah. What did she say?' said Boy Willie. "'She smiled at me,' said Caleb. He scratched his crusty beard uneasily. "'A bit, anyway,' he added. "'Good,' said Mr. Savaloy. "'She, uh, she said she'd... She wouldn't mind seeing me later. Well done. Uh, teach. What, what's a shave? Savaloy explained. Caleb listened carefully, grimacing occasionally. He turned around occasionally to look at the duck seller, who gave him a little wave. Cool, he said. Um, I don't know. He looked around again. Never seen a woman who wasn't running away before. Our oh, women are like deer, said Cohen loftily. You can't just charge in, you've got to stalk them. <laughs> Sorry, said Caleb, catching Mr. Savaloy's stern eye. I think perhaps we should end the lesson here, said Mr. Savaloy. We don't want to get you too civilised, do we? I suggest we take a stroll around the Forbidden City, yes? They'd all seen it. It dominated the centre of Hung Hung. Its walls were forty feet high. There's a lot of soldiers guarding the gates, said Cohen. So they should. A great treasure lies within, said Mr. Savaloy. He didn't raise his eyes, though. He seemed to be staring intently at the ground as though searching for something he'd lost. Why don't we just rush up and kill the guards? Caleb demanded. He was still feeling a bit shaken. What? Don't be daft, said Cohen. It'd take all day. Anyway, he added, feeling a little proud despite himself, Teach here is going to get us in on an invisible duck. Ain't that so, Teach? Mr. Savaloy stopped. Ah, oh, Eureka, he said. That's a Phoebean, that is, Cohen told the horde. It means, give me a towel. Oh, yeah, said Caleb, who had been surreptitiously trying to untangle the knots in his beard. And when were you ever in Ephib? Went bounty hunting there once. Who for? You, I think. Huh, 
Did you find me? Dunno. Nod your head and see if it falls off. Ah, gentlemen, behold. Mr. Savaloy's orthopedic sandal was prodding an ornamental metal square in the ground. Behold what? said Truckle. What? We should look for more of these, said Mr. Savaloy, but I think we have it. All we need to do now is wait until dark. There was an argument going on. All Rincewind could make out were the voices. Another sack had been tied over his head while he himself was tied to a pillar. Does he even look like a great wizard? That's what it says on his hat in the language of ghosts. So, you say. What about the testimony of four big sandals, then? He was overtaxed. He could have imagined it. I did not. He came out of thin air, flying like a dragon. He knocked over five soldiers, and three Maximum Lux saw it also, and the others. And then he freed an ancient man, and turned him into a mighty fighting warrior. And he can speak our language, just as it says in the book. All right, supposing he is the great wizard, then we should kill him now. In the darkness of his sack, Rincewind shook his head furiously. Why? He will be on the side of the emperor. But the legend says the great wizard led the red army. Yes, for Emperor Wan Sang Mira, it crushed the people. No, it crushed all the bandit chiefs. Then it built the empire. So, the empire is so great, untimely demise to the forces of oppression? But now the Red Army is on the side of the people. Maximum advancement with the Great Wizard. The Great Wizard is the enemy of the people. I saw him, I tell you. A legion of soldiers collapsed with the wind of his passage. The wind of his passage was beginning to worry Rincewind as well. It always tended to when he was frightened. If he is such a great wizard, why is he still tied up? Why has he not made his bonds disappear in puffs of green smoke? Perhaps he is saving his magic for some even mightier deeds. He wouldn't do firecracker tricks for earthworms. <laughs> and he had the book. He was looking for us. It is his destiny to lead the Red Army. Shake, 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 shake. We can lead ourselves. Nod, 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 nod. We don't need any suspicious great wizards from illusionary places. Nod, 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 nod. So we should kill him now. Nod, nod, nod. Shake, 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 shake. Ha! He laughs at you with scorn. He waits to make your head explode with snakes of fire. Shake, 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 shake. You do know that while we're arguing, three yoked oxen is being tortured. The people's army is more than just individuals, Lotus Blossom. In the feated sack, Rincewind grimaced. He was already beginning to take a dislike to the first speaker, as one naturally does with people urging that you be put to death without delay. But when that sort of person started talking about things being more important than people, you knew you were in big trouble. I'm sure the great wizard could rescue three yoked oxen, said a voice by his ear. It was Butterfly. Yes, he could easily rescue three yoked oxen, said Lotus Blossom. Ha, huh, you say? He could get into the forbidden city? Impossible. It's certain death. Nod, nod, nod. Not to the great wizard, said the voice of Butterfly. Shut up, hissed Rincewind. Would you like to know how big the meat cleaver is that the two fire herb is holding in his hand? whispered Butterfly. No, it's very big. He said that going into the Forbidden City is certain death. No, it's only probable death. I assure you, if you run away from me again, that is certain death. The sack was pulled away. The face immediately in front of him was that of Lotus Blossom, and a man could see a lot worse things with his daylight than her face, which made him think of cream and masses of butter and just the right amount of salt. Much later, Rincewind had to have therapy for this. It involved a pretty woman, a huge plate of potatoes and a big stick with a nail in it. 
One of the things he might see, for example, was the face of two fire herb. This was not a nice face. It was podgy and had tiny little pupils in its eyes, and looked like a living example of the fact that although the people could be oppressed by kings and emperors and mandarins, the job could often be done just as well by the man next door. Great wizard, <laughs> two fire herb said. Now, he can do it," said Lotus Blossom. And Cream Cheese thought Rincewind and maybe Coleslaw on the side. He is the great wizard come back to us. Did he not guide the master through the lands of ghosts and blood-sucking vampires? Oh, I wouldn't say that," Rincewind began. Such a great wizard allowed you to bring him here in a sack," said Two Fire Herb, sneering. "Let us see him do some conjuring." A truly great wizard would not stoop to doing party tricks," said Lotus Blossom. "That's right," said Rincewind. "Not stoop." Shame on Herb to suggest such a thing. Shame," Rincewind agreed. Besides. He will need all of his power to enter the Forbidden City," said Butterfly. Rincewind found himself hating the sound of her voice. "Forbidden City," he murmured. "Everyone knows there are terrible snares and traps, and many, many guards. Snares, traps. Why, if his magic should fail him because he did tricks for Herb, he would find himself in the deepest dungeon, dying by inches." Inches, um, which particular inches? So much shame to two fire herb. Rincewind gave her a sickly grin. Actually, he said, I'm not that great. I'm a bit great, he added quickly as Butterfly began to frown, but not very great. The writings of the master say that you defeated many powerful enchanters and resolutely succeeded in dangerous situations. Rincewind nodded glumly. It was more or less true, but most of the time he hadn't intended to. Whereas the Forbidden City had looked, well, forbidden. It didn't look inviting. It didn't look as though it sold postcards. The only souvenir they were likely to give you would be perhaps your teeth, in a bag. Um, I expect this oxen lad is in some deep dungeon, yeah? The deepest. Said Two Fire Herb, and you've never seen anyone again, who's been taken prisoner. I mean, we've seen bits of them," said Lotus Blossom. "Usually their heads," said Two Fire Herb, "on spikes, over the gates." But not three yoked oxen," said Lotus Blossom firmly. "The Great Wizard has spoken." Actually, I'm not sure. I actually said. But you have spoken," said Butterfly firmly. As Rincewind got accustomed to the gloom, he realized that he was in some storeroom or cellar. The noise of the city came rather muffled from grills near the ceiling. It was half full of barrels and bundles, and every one of them was a perch for someone. The room was crowded. The people were watching him with expressions of rapt attention. But that wasn't the only thing they had in common. Rincewind turned right round. Who were all these children? He said. This, said Lotus Blossom, is the hung hung cadre of the Red Army. Two Fire Herb snorted. Why did you tell him that? He said. Now we may have to kill him. But they're all so young. They may be underprivileged in years, said Two Fire Herb, but they are ancient in courage and honor. And experienced in fighting," said Rincewind hotly. "The guards I've seen do not look like nice people. I mean, do you even have any weapons? We will wrest the weapons we need from our enemies," said Two Fire Herb. A cheer went up. "Really? How do you actually make them let go?" said Rincewind. He pointed to a very small girl who leaned away from his digit as though it were loaded. She looked about seven and was holding a toy rabbit. "What's your name?" One favorite pearl, great wizard. And what do you do in the Red Army? I have earned the medal for putting up of wall posters, great wizard. What, like slightly bad things please happen to our enemies, that sort of thing? Um," said the girl, looking imploringly at Butterfly. 
Rebellion is not easy for us, said the older girl. We don't have experience. Well, I'm here to tell you that you don't do it by singing songs and putting up posters and fighting barehanded, said Rincewind. Not when you're up against real people with real weapons. You... His voice trailed away as he realised that a hundred pairs of eyes were watching him intently, and two hundred ears were carefully listening. He played back his own words in the echo chamber of his head. He'd said, I'm here to tell you. He spread out his hands and waved them frantically. That it's... it's not up to me to tell you anything, he said. That is correct, said Two Fire Herb. We will overcome because history is on our side. We will overcome because the great wizard is on our side, said Butterfly sharply. I'll tell you this, shouted Rincewind. I'd rather trust me than history. Oh, shit, did I just say that? So you will help three yoked oxen, said Butterfly. Please, said Lotus Blossom. Rincewind looked at her, and the tears in the corners of her eyes, and the bunch of awed teenagers who really thought that you could beat an army by singing rousing songs. There was only one thing he could do, if he really thought about it. He could play along for now, and then get the hell out of it at the very first opportunity. Butterfly's anger was bad, but a spike was a spike. Of course he'd feel a bit of a heel for a while, but that was the point. He'd feel a heel, but he wouldn't feel a spike. The world had too many heroes and didn't need another one, whereas the world had only one Rincewind, and he owed it to the world to keep this one alive for as long as possible. There was an inn. There was a courtyard. There was a corral for the luggages. There were large travelling trunks, big enough to carry the needs of an entire household for a fortnight. There were merchant sample cases, mere square boxes on crude legs, there were sleek overnight bags. They shuffled aimlessly in their pen. Occasionally there was the rattle of a handle or the crack of a hinge, and once or twice the snap of a lid and the bonk, bonk, bonk of boxes trying to get out of the way. Three of them were big and covered with studded leather. They looked like the kind of travelling accessories that hang around outside cheap hotels and make suggestive remarks to handbags. The object of their attention was a rather smaller trunk with an inlaid lid and dainty feet. It had already backed into a corner as far as it could go. A large spiked lid creaked open a couple of times as the largest of the boxes edged closer. The smaller box had retreated so far its back legs were trying to climb the corral fence. There was the sound of running feet on the other side of the courtyard wall. They got closer and then stopped abruptly. Then there was a twang such as would be made by an object landing on the taut roof of a cart. For a moment... Against the rising moon, there was the shape of something somersaulting slowly through the evening air. It landed heavily in front of the three big chests, bounced upright, and charged. Eventually various travellers spilled out into the night, but by then items of clothing were strewn and trampled around the courtyard. Three black chests, battered and scarred, were discovered on the roof, each one scrabbling on the tiles and butting the others in an effort to be the highest. Others had panicked and broken down the wall and headed out across the country. Eventually, all but one of them were found. The Horde were feeling quite proud of themselves when they sat down for dinner. They acted, Mr. Savaloy thought, rather like boys who'd just got their first pair of long trousers, which they had done. Each man had one baggy pair of same, plus a long grey robe. We've been shopping, said Caleb proudly. Paying for things with money. We're dressed up like civilised people. Yes, indeed, said Mr. Savaloy indulgently. He was hoping that they could all get through this without the horde finding out what kind of civilised people they were dressed up as. As it was, the beards were a problem. The kind of people who wore these kind of clothes in the Forbidden City didn't usually have beards. They were proverbial for not having them. Actually, they were more properly proverbial for not having other things, but as a sort of consequence of this lack, also for not having beards. Cohen shifted. Itchy, he said. This is pants, is it? Never worn them before. Same with shirts. What good's a shirt that's not chain mail? We did very well, though, said Caleb. He had even had a shave obliging the barber, for the first time in his experience, to use a chisel. 
He kept rubbing his naked, baby pink chin. Yeah, we're really civilized, said Vincent. Except for the bit where you set fire to that shopkeeper, said Boy Willie. No, I only set fire to him a bit. What? said Mad Hamish. Teach? Yes, Cohen. Why did you tell that firework merchant that everyone you knew had died suddenly? Mr. Savaloy's foot tapped gently against the large parcel under the table, alongside a nice new cauldron. So he wouldn't get suspicious about what I was buying, he said. Five thousand firecrackers? What? Well, said Mr. Savaloy, did I ever tell you that after I taught geography in the Assassins Guild and the Plumbers Guild, I did it for a few terms in the Alchemists Guild? Alchemists, loonies, the lot of them, said Truckle. But they're keen on geography, said Mr. Savaloy. I suppose they need to know where they've landed. Eat up, gentlemen. It may be a long night. What is this stuff? Said Truckle, spearing something with his chopstick. Um, chow, said Mr. Savaloy. Yes, but what is it? Chow, a kind of um, dog. The horde looked at him. There's nothing wrong with it, he said hurriedly, with the sincerity of a man who had ordered bamboo shoots and bean curd for himself. I've eaten everything else, said Truckle, but I ain't eating dog. I had a dog once, Rover. Yeah, said Cohen, the one with the spiked collar, the one who used to eat people. Say what you like. He was a friend to me, said Truckle, pushing the meat to one side. Rabid death to everyone else. I'll eat yours. Order him some chicken, Teach. Eat a man once, mumbled Mad Hamish. In a siege, it were. You ate someone, said Mr. Savaloy, beckoning to the waiter. Just a leg. That's terrible. Not with mustard. Just when I think I know them, Mr. Savaloy mused. He reached for his wine glass. The horde reached for their glasses too, while watching him carefully. A toast, gentlemen, he said, and remember what I said about not quaffing. Quaffing just gets your ears wet. Just. Sip. To civilization. The horde joined in with their own toasts. Pacharn cough. Your feet shall be cut off and be buried several yards from your body, so your ghost won't walk. Lie down on the floor and no one gets hurt. May you live in interesting pants. What's the magic word? Gimme. Death to most tyrants. What? The walls of the Forbidden City are forty feet high," said Butterfly, "and the gates are made of brass. There are hundreds of guards, but of course we have the Great Wizard. Who? You? Oh, sorry, I was forgetting. Yes," said Butterfly, giving Rincewind a long, appraising look. Rincewind remembered tutors giving him a look like that when he'd got high marks in some test by simply guessing at the answers. He looked down hurriedly at the charcoal scrawls Lotus Blossom had made. Cohen had known what to do. He thought he'd just slaughter his way through. It had never crossed his mind to be afraid or worried. He's the kind of man you need at a time like this. No doubt you have magic spells that can blow down the walls," said Lotus Blossom. Rincewind wondered what they would do to him when it turned out that he couldn't. Not a lot, he thought. If I'm already running, of course they could curse his memory and call him names, but he was used to that. Sticks and stones may break my bones, he thought. He was vaguely aware that there was a second half to the saying, but he'd never bothered because the first half always occupied all his attention. Even the luggage had left him. That was a minor bright spot, but he missed the patter of little feet. Before we start, he said, "I think you ought to sing a revolutionary song." The cadre liked the idea. Under cover of their chanting, he sidled over to Butterfly, who gave him a knowing smile. "You know I can't do it." The master said you were very resourceful. I can't magic a hole in a wall. 
I'm sure you'll think of something. And, great wizard. Yes, what? Favorite pearl, the child with the toy rabbit. Yes. The cadre is all she has. The same goes for many of the others. When the warlords fight, lots of people die. Parents. Do you understand? I was one of the first to read what I did on my holidays, great wizard. And what I saw in there was a foolish man who for some reason is always lucky, great wizard. I hope for everyone's sake you have a great deal of luck, especially for yours. Fountains tinkled in the courts of the Sun Emperor. Peacocks made their call, which sounds like a sound made by something that shouldn't look as beautiful as that. Ornamental trees cast their shade as only they know how, ornamentally. The gardens occupied the heart of the city, and it was possible to hear the noises from outside, although these were muted because of the straw spread daily on the nearest streets, and also because any sound considered too loud would earn its originator a very brief stay in prison. Of the gardens, the most aesthetically pleasing was the one laid out by the first emperor, one sung mirror. It consisted entirely of gravel and stones, but artfully raked and laid out as it might be by a mountain torrent with a refined artistic sense. It was here that one sun mirror, in whose reign the empire had been unified and the great wall built, came to refresh his soul and dwell upon the essential unity of all things, while drinking wine out of the skull of some enemy, or possibly a gardener who had been too clumsy with his rake. At the moment the garden was occupied by two little Wang, the master of protocol, who came there because he felt it was good for his nerves. Perhaps it was the number two he'd always told himself. It was an unlucky birth number. Being called Little Wang was merely a lack of courtesy detail, a sort of minor seagull dropping after the very great heap of buffalo excrement that heaven had pasted into his very horoscope. Although he had to admit that he hadn't made things any better by allowing himself to become master of protocol. It had seemed such a good idea at the time. He'd risen gently through the Agatean civil service by mastering those arts essential to the practice of good government and administration, such as calligraphy, origami, flower arranging, and the five wonderful forms of poetry. He dutifully got on with the tasks assigned to him, and noticed only vaguely that there didn't seem to be quite as many high-ranking members of the civil service as there used to be. And then one day, a lot of senior mandarins, most of them a lot more senior than he was, it occurred to him later, had rushed up to him while he was trying to find a rhyme for Orange Blossom, and congratulated him on being the new master. That had been three months ago. And of the things that had occurred to him in those intervening three months, the most shameful was this. He had come to believe that the Sun Emperor was not in fact the Lord of Heaven, the Pillar of the Sky, and the Great River of Blessings, but an evil-minded madman whose death had been too long delayed. It was an awful thought. It was like hating motherhood and raw fish, or objecting to sunlight. Most people develop their social conscience when young, during that brief period between leaving school and deciding that injustice isn't necessarily all bad, and it was something of a shock to suddenly find one at the age of sixty. It wasn't that he was against the golden rules— it made sense that a man prone to thieving should have his hands cut off. It prevented him from thieving again, and thus tarnishing his soul. A peasant who could not pay his taxes should be executed, in order to prevent him falling into the temptation of slothfulness and public disorder. And since the empire was created by heaven as the only true world of human beings, all else outside being a land of ghosts, it was certainly in order to execute those who questioned this state of affairs but he felt that it wasn't right to laugh happily while doing so. It wasn't pleasant that these things should happen. It was merely necessary. From somewhere in the distance came the screams. The emperor was playing chess again. He preferred to use live pieces. Two little Wang felt heavy with the knowledge. There had been better times. He knew that now. Things hadn't always been the way they were. Emperors didn't used to be cruel clowns around whom it was as safe as mudbanks in the crocodile season. There hadn't always been a civil war every time an emperor died. Warlords hadn't run the country. People had rights as well as duties. And then one day the succession had been called into question, and there was a war, and since then it had never seemed to go right. Soon, with any luck, the emperor would die. No doubt a special hell was being made ready. 
and then there'd be the usual battle, and then there'd be a new emperor, and if he was very lucky, too little Wang would be beheaded, which was what tended to happen to people who had risen to high office under a previous incumbent. But that was quite reasonable by modern standards, since it was possible these days to be beheaded for interrupting the emperor's thoughts, or standing in the wrong place. At which point, two little Wang heard ghosts. They seemed to be right under his feet. They were talking in a strange language, so to two little Wang the speech was merely sounds, which went as follows. Where the hell are we? Somewhere under the palace, I'm sure. Look for another manhole in the ceiling. What? I'm fed up with pushing this dumb wheelchair. It's me for a hot foot bath after this, I'm telling you. You call this a way to enter a city. You call this a way to enter a city, waist deep in water. We didn't enter a wretched city like this when I rode with Bruce the Hoon. You enter a love-making city by overrunning it with a thousand horsemen. That's how you take a city. Yes, but there ain't room for them in this pipe. The sounds had a hollow booming quality to them. With a kind of fascinated puzzlement, two little Wang followed them, walking across the manicured gravel in an unthinking way that would have earned him an immediate tongue extraction from its original lover of peace and tranquility. Can we please hurry? I'd like us to be out of here when the cauldron goes off, and I didn't really have much time to experiment with the fuses. I still don't understand about the cauldron, Teach. I hope all those firecrackers will blow a hole in the wall. Right, so why ain't we there? Why are we in this pipe? Because all the guards will rush to see what the bang was. Right, so we should be there. No, we should be here, Cohen. The word is decoy. It's more civilised this way. Two little Wang pressed his ear to the ground. What's the penalty for entering the Forbidden City again, Teach? I believe it's a punishment similar to hanging, drawing and quartering. So you see, it would be a good idea if there was a very faint sound of splashing. How are you drawn, then? I think your innards are cut out and shown to you. What for? I don't really know. To see if you recognise them, I suppose. What, like, yep, that's my kidneys, yep, that's my breakfast? How are you quartered? Is that like they give you somewhere to stay? Um, I, I think not, from the context. For a while there was no sound but the splash of six pairs of feet and the squeak-squeak of what sounded like a wheel. Well, how are you hung? Excuse me? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Two little Wang tripped over a two-hundred-year-old bonsai tree and hid his head on a rock chosen for its fundamental serenity. When he came around a few seconds later, the voices had gone, if there had ever been any. Ghosts. There were a lot of ghosts around these days. Two little Wang wished he'd had a few firecrackers to scatter around. Being master of protocol was even worse than trying to find a rhyme for orange blossom. Flares lit the alleys of Hung Hung. With the Red Army chattering behind him, Rincewind wandered up to the wall of the Forbidden City. No one knew better than Rincewind that he was totally incapable of proper magic. He'd only ever done it by accident. So he could be sure that if he waved a hand and said some magic words, the wall would in all probability become just a little bit less full of holes than it was now. It was a shame to disappoint Lotus Blossom with her body that reminded Rincewind of a plate of crinkle-cut chips but it was about time she learned that you couldn't rely on wizards. And then he could be out of here. What could Butterfly do to him if he tried and failed? And, much to his surprise, he found himself hoping that on the way out he could poke Herb in the eye. He was amazed the others couldn't spot him for what he was. This area of wall was between gates. The life of Hung Hung lapped against it like a muddy sea. There were stalls and booths everywhere. Rincewind had thought Ankh Morpork citizens lived out on the streets, but they were agrophobes compared to the Hung Hungese. 
Funerals with associated firecrackers and wedding parties and religious ceremonies went on alongside and intermingled with the normal market activities such as free-form livestock slaughter and world-class arguing. Herb pointed to a clear area of the wall stacked with timber. Just about there, great wizard, he sneered. Do not exert yourself unduly. A small hole should be sufficient. But there's hundreds of people around. Is that a problem to such a great wizard? Perhaps you can't do it with people watching. I have no doubt that the great wizard will astonish us, said Butterfly. When the people see the power of the great wizard, they will speak of it forever, said Lotus Blossom. Probably, muttered Rincewind. The cadre stopped talking, although it was only possible to notice this by watching their closed mouths. The hole left by their silence was soon filled by the babble of the market. Rincewind rolled up his sleeves. He wasn't even certain about a spell for blowing things up. He waved a hand vaguely. I should stand well back, everyone, said Herb, grinning unpleasantly. Quanti canicula illa in fenestri, said Rincewind. Um, he stared desperately at the wall, and with that heightened perception that comes to those on the edge of terror, noticed a cauldron half hidden in the timber. There seemed to be a little glowing string attached to it. Um, he said, there seems to be... Having problems, said Herb nastily. Rincewind squared his shoulders. Mm, he said. There was a sound like a marshmallow gently landing on a plate, and everything in front of him went white. Then the white turned red, streaked with black, and the terrible noise clapped its hands across his ears. A crescent-shaped piece of something glowing scythed the top of his hat and embedded itself in the nearest house, which caught fire. There was a strong smell of burning eyebrows. When the debris settled, Rincewind saw quite a large hole in the wall. Around its edge, the brickwork, now a red-hot ceramic, started to cool with a noise like... Glinka, glinka. He looked down at his soot-blackened hands. Gosh, he said. And then he said, All right. And then he turned and began to say, How about that then? But his voice faded when it became apparent that everyone was lying flat on the ground. A duck watched him suspiciously from its cage. Owing to the slight protection afforded by the bars, its feathers were patterned alternately natural and crispy. He'd always wanted to do magic like that. He'd always been able to visualize it perfectly. He'd just never been able to do it. A number of guards appeared in the gap. One, whose ferocity of helmet suggested that he was an officer, glared at the charred hole and then at Rincewind. Did you do this? he demanded. Stand back, shouted Rincewind, drunk with power. I'm the great wizard I am. You see this finger? Don't make me use it. The officer nodded to a couple of his men. Get him. Rincewind took a step back. I warn you, anyone lays a hand on me, he'll be eating flies and hopping for the rest of his life. The guards advanced with the determination of those who were prepared to risk the uncertainty of magic against the definite prospect of punishment for disobeying orders. Stand back. This could go off. All right, then, since you force me. He waved his hands. He snapped his fingers a few times. Um, the guards, after checking that they were still the same shape, each grabbed an arm. It may be delayed action, he ventured as they gripped harder. Alternatively, would you be interested in hearing a famous quotation, he said. His feet were lifted off the ground. Or perhaps not. Rincewind, running absent-mindedly in mid-air, was brought in front of the officer. On your knees, rebel, said the officer. I'd like to, but I saw what you did to Captain Four White Fox. What? Who's he? Take him to the Emperor. As he was dragged off, Rincewind saw for one brief moment the guards closing on the Red Army, swords flashing. A metal plate shuddered for a moment and then dropped on the floor. Careful. I ain't used to being careful. Bruce the Hoon wasn't care... Shut up about Bruce the Hoon. Well, dang you too. What? Anyone out there?
Cohen stuck his head out of the pipe. The room was dark, damp, and full of pipes and runnels. Water went off in every direction to feed fountains and cisterns. No, he said in a disappointed voice. Very well, everyone out of the pipe. There was some echoey swearing and a scrape of metal as Hamish's wheelchair was manoeuvred into the long, low cellar. Mr. Savaloy lit a match as the horde spread out and examined their surroundings. Congratulations, gentlemen, he said. I believe we are in the palace. Yeah, said Truckle. We've conquered a, f- a-, a love-making pipe. What good is that? We could rape it, said Caleb, hopefully. Hey, this wheel thing turns. What's a love-making pipe? What does this lever do? What? said Mad Hamish. How about we find a door, rush out, and kill everyone? Mr. Savaloy closed his eyes. There was something familiar about this situation, and now he realised what it was. He'd once taken an entire class on a school trip to the city armoury. His right leg still hurt him on wet days. No, 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 he said. What good would that do? Boy, Willie, please don't pull that lever. Well, I'd feel better for one, said Cohen. Ain't killed anyone all day except a guard, and they hardly count. Remember that we're here for theft, not murder, said Mr. Savaloy. Now, please, out of all that wet leather and into your nice new clothes. I don't like this part, said Cohen, pulling on a shirt. I like people to know who I was. Yeah, said Boy Willie. Without our leather and mail, people will just think we're a load of old men. Exactly, said Mr. Savaloy. That is part of the subterfuge. Is that like... Tactics, said Cohen. Yes. All right, but I don't like it, said old Vincent. Supposing we win, what kind of song will the minstrels sing about people who invaded through a pipe? An echoey one, said boy Willie. They won't sing anything like that, said Cohen firmly. You pay a minstrel enough, he'll sing whatever you want. A flight of damp steps led to a door. Mr. Savaloy was already at the top, listening. That's right, said Caleb. They say that whoever pays the piper calls the tune. But, gentlemen, said Mr. Savaloy, his eyes bright, whoever holds a knife to the piper's throat writes the symphony. The assassin moved slowly through Lord Hong's chambers. He was one of the best in Hung Hung's small but very select guild, and he certainly was not a rebel. He disliked rebels. They were invariably poor people, and therefore unlikely to be customers. His mode of movement was unusual and cautious. It avoided the floor. Lord Hong was known to tune his floorboards. It made considerable use of furniture and decorative screens, and occasionally of the ceiling as well. And the assassin was very good at it. When a messenger entered the room through a distant door, he froze for an instant, and then moved in perfect rhythm towards his quarry, letting the newcomer's clumsy footsteps mask his own. Lord Hong was making another sword. The folding of the metal and all the tedious yet essential bouts of heating and hammering were, he found, conducive to clear thinking. Too much pure cerebration was bad for the mind. Lord Hong liked to use his hands sometimes. He plunged the sword back into the furnace and pumped the bellows a few times. Yes, he said. The messenger looked up from his prone position near the floor. Good news, O Lord. We have captured the Red Army. Well, that is good news, said Lord Hong, watching the blade carefully for the change of colour, including the one they call the Great Wizard. Indeed, but he is not that great, O Lord, said the messenger. His cheerfulness faded when Lord Hong raised an eyebrow. Really? On the contrary, I suspect him of being in possession of huge and dangerous powers. Yes, O Lord, I did not mean... See that they are all locked up 
and send a message to Captain Five Hong Man to undertake the orders I gave him today. Yes, O、oh、Lord. And now, stand up. The messenger stood up, trembling. Lord Hong pulled on a thick glove and reached for the sword handle. The furnace roared. Chin up, man. My lord. Now, open your eyes wide. There was no need for that order. Lord Hong peered into the mask of terror, noted the flicker of movement, nodded, and then, in one almost balletic movement, pulled the spitting blade from the furnace, turned, thrust. There was a very brief scream and a rather longer hiss. Lord Hong let the assassin sag. Then he tugged the sword free, and inspected the steaming blade. Sir,、hmm. he said, "Interesting." He caught sight of the messenger. Are you still here? No, my lord. See to it. Lord Hong turned the sword so that the light caught it and examined the edge. Um, shall I send some servant to clear away the、uh, body? What? Said Lord Hong, lost in thought. The body, Lord Hong. What body? Oh, yes. See to it. The walls were beautifully decorated. Even Rincewind noticed this, though they went past in a blur. Some had marvelous birds painted on them, or mountain scenes, or sprays of foliage. Every leaf and bud done in exquisite detail, with just a couple of brush strokes. Ceramic lions reared on marble pedestals. Vases bigger than Rincewind lined the corridors. Lacquered doors opened ahead of the guards. Rincewind was briefly aware of huge, ornate, and empty rooms stretching away on either side. Finally, they passed through yet another set of doors, and he was flung down on a wooden floor. In these circumstances, he always found it was best not to look up. Eventually, an officious voice said. What do you have to say for yourself, miserable louse? Well, I silence. Ah, so it was going to be that kind of interview. A different voice, a cracked, breathless, and elderly voice, said, "Where is the Grand Vizier? He has retired to his rooms, O、oh、Great One. He said he had a headache." Summon him at once. Certainly, a great one. Rincewind, his nose pressed firmly to the floor, made some further assumptions. Grand Vizier was always a bad sign. It generally meant that people were going to suggest wild horses and red-hot chains. And when people were called things like "O、oh、great one," it was pretty certain that there was no appeal. This is. A rebel, is it? The sentence was wheezed rather than spoken. Indeed, O Great One. I think I would like a closer look. There was a general murmur, suggesting that a number of people had been greatly surprised, and then the sound of furniture being moved. Rincewind thought he saw a blanket on the edge of his vision. Someone was wheeling a bed across the floor. Make it stand up. The gurgle in the paws was like the last bath water going down the plug hole. It sucked as wetly as an outgoing wave. Once again, a foot kicked Rincewind in the kidneys, making its usual explicit request in the Esperanto of brutality. He got up. It was a bed, and quite the biggest Rincewind had ever seen. In it, swathed in brocades and almost lost in pillows, was an old man. Rincewind had never seen anyone look so ill. The face was pale, with a greenish pallor. Veins showed up under the skin of his hands like worms in a jar. The emperor had all the qualifications for a corpse, except, as it were, the most vital one. So, this is the new great wizard of whom. We have read so much, is it? He said. When he spoke, people waited expectantly for the final gurgle in mid-sentence. Well, I. Silence! Screamed the chamberlain. 
Rincewind shrugged. He hadn't known what to expect of an emperor, but the mental picture had room for a big fat man with lots of rings. Talking to this one was a hair's breadth from necromancy. Can you show us some more magic, great wizard? Rincewind glanced at the chamberlain. Whoa, silence! The emperor waved a hand vaguely, gurgled with the effort, and gave Rincewind another inquiring look. Rincewind decided to chance things. I've got a good one, he said. It's a vanishing trick. Can you do it now? Only if everyone opens all the doors and turns their back. The Emperor's expression did not change. The court fell silent. Then there was a sound like a number of small rabbits being choked to death. The Emperor was laughing. Once this was established, everyone else laughed too. No one can get a laugh like a man who can have you put to death more easily than he goes to the lavatory. What shall we do with you? he said. Where is the Grand Vizier? The crowd parted. Rincewind risked a sideways squint. Once you were in the hands of a Grand Vizier, you were dead. Grand Viziers were always scheming megalomaniacs. It was probably in the job description. Are you a devious, plotting, unreliable madman? Ah, oh, good. Then you can be my most trusted minister. Ah, Lord Hong, said the Emperor. Mercy, suggested Rincewind. Silence, screamed the Chamberlain. Tell me, Lord Hong, said the ancient Emperor, what would be the punishment for a foreigner entering the forbidden city? Removal of all limbs, ears, and eyes, and then allowed to go free, said Lord Hong. Rincewind raised his hand. First offence, he said. Silence. We find generally that there is no second offence, said Lord Hong. What is this person? I like him, said the Emperor. I think I shall keep him. He makes me laugh. Rincewind opened his mouth. Silence! screamed the Chamberlain, perhaps unwisely in view of current thinking. Um, could you stop him shouting silence every time I try and speak? Rincewind ventured. Certainly, great wizard, said the Emperor. He nodded at some guards. Take the Chamberlain away and cut his lips off. Great one, I... And his ears also... The wretched man was dragged away. A pair of lacquered doors slammed shut. There was a round of applause from the courtiers. Would you like to watch him eat them? Said the emperor, grinning happily. It's tremendous fun. <laughs> said Rinchwind. A good decision, Lord, said Lord Hong. He turned his head towards Rinchwind. To the wizard's immense surprise, and some horror, too, he winked. Oh, great one, said a plump courtier, dropping to his knees, bouncing slightly, and then nervously approaching the emperor. I wonder if perhaps it is entirely wise to be so merciful to this foreign devil. The emperor looked down. Rincewind could have sworn that dust fell off him. There was a gentle movement among the crowd. Without anyone apparently doing anything so gross as activating their feet, there was nevertheless a widening space around the kneeling man. Then the Emperor smiled. Your concern is well received, he said. The courtier risked a relieved grin. The Emperor added, However, your presumption is not... Kill him slowly, over several days. Oh. 
Yes, indeed. Lots of boiling oil. An excellent idea, O、oh、Lord," said Lord Hong. The Emperor turned back to Rincewind. I am sure the Great Wizard is my friend," he suctioned. Ah," <laughs> said Rincewind. He'd been in this approximate position before. Gods knew, but he'd always been facing someone—well, usually someone who looked like Lord Hong, not a near corpse who was nearly so far round the bend he couldn't poke sanity with a long pole. We shall have such fun," said the Emperor. "I read all about you," <laughs> said Rincewind. The Emperor waved a hand at the court again. Now I will retire," he said. There was a general movement and much ostensible yawning. Clearly, no one stayed up later than the Emperor. Emperor said, "Lord Hong wearily, what will you have us do with this great wizard of yours?" The old man gave Rincewind the look a present gets around the time the batteries have run out. Put him in the special dungeon," he said. "For now." "Yes, Emperor," said Lord Hong. He nodded at a couple of guards. Rincewind managed a quick look back as he was dragged from the room. The Emperor was lying back in his movable bed, quite oblivious to him. "Is he mad or what?" he said. "Silence." Rincewind looked up at the guard who'd said that. A mouth like that could get a man into big trouble around here," he muttered. Lord Hong always found himself depressed by the general state of humanity. It often seemed to him to be flawed. There was no concentration. Take the Red Army. If he had been a rebel, the Emperor would have been assassinated months ago, and the country would now be aflame, except for those bits too damp to burn. But these. Despite his best efforts, their idea of revolutionary activity was a surreptitious wall poster saying something like, "Unpleasantness to oppressors when convenient." They had tried to set fire to guard houses. That was good. That was proper revolutionary activity, except for the bit where they tried to make an appointment first. It had taken Lord Hong some considerable effort to see that the Red Army appeared to achieve any victories at all. Well, he'd given them the great wizard they so sincerely believed in. They had no excuse now, and by the look of him, the wretch was as craven and talentless as Lord Hong had hoped. Any army led by him would either flee or be slaughtered, leaving the way open for the counter-revolution. The counter-revolution would not be inefficient. Lord Hong would see to that. But things had to be done one step at a time. There were enemies everywhere, suspicious enemies. The path of the ambitious man was a nightingale floor. One wrong step, and it would sing out. It was a shame the great wizard would turn out to be so good at locks. Lord Tang's men were guarding the prison block tonight. Of course, if the Red Army were to escape, no blame at all could possibly attach to Lord Tang. Lord Hong risked a little chuckle to himself as he strode back to his suite. Proof. That was the thing. There must never be proof. But that wouldn't matter very long. There was nothing like a fearsomely huge war to unite people, and the fact that the great wizard, that is the leader of the terrible rebel army, was an evil foreign troublemaker, was just a spark to light the firecracker. And then, Ankh Morpork, urinating dog. Hung Hung was old. The culture was based on custom, the alimentary tract of the common water buffalo, and base treachery. Lord Hong was in favour of all three, but they did not add up to world domination. And Lord Hong was particularly in favour of that, provided it was achieved by Lord Hong. If I was the traditional type of Grand Vizier, he thought as he sat down before his tea table, I'd cackle with laughter at this point. He smiled to himself instead. Time for the box again? No. Some things were all the better for the anticipation. Mad Hamish's wheelchair caused a few heads to turn, but no actual comment. Undue curiosity was not a survival trait in Hung Hung.
They just got on with their work, which appeared to be the endless carrying of stacks of paper along corridors. Cohen looked down at what was in his hand. Over the decades, he'd fought with many weapons. Swords, of course, and bows and spears and clubs and... Well, now he came to think of it just about anything. Except this. I still don't like it, said Truckle. Why are we carrying pieces of paper? Because no one looks at you in a place like this if you're carrying a piece of paper, said Mr. Savaloy. Why? What? said Mad Hamish. It's a kind of magic. I'd feel happier if it was a weapon. As a matter of fact, it can be the greatest weapon there is. I know. I've just cut myself on my bit, said Boy Willie, sucking his finger. What? Look at it like this, gentlemen, said Mr. Savaloy. Here we are, actually inside the Forbidden City, and no one is dead. Yes, that's what we're danging, complaining about, said Truckle. Mr. Savaloy sighed. There was something in the way Truckle used words. It didn't matter what he actually said. What you heard was in some strange way the word he actually meant. He could turn the air blue just by saying, socks. The door slammed shut behind Rincewind, and there was the sound of a bolt shooting into place. The Empire's jails were pretty much like the ones at home. When you want to incarcerate such an ingenious creature as the common human being, you tend to rely on the good old-fashioned iron bar and large amounts of stone. It looked as though this well-tried pattern had been established here for a very long time. Well, he definitely scored a hit with the Emperor. For some reason, this did not reassure him. The man gave Rincewind the distinct impression of being the kind of person who was at least as dangerous to his friends as to his enemies. He remembered Noodle Jackson back in the days when he was a very young student. Everyone wanted to be friends with Noodle, but somehow, if you were in his gang, you found yourself being trodden on, or chased by the watch, or being hit in fights you didn't start, while Noodle was somewhere on the edge of things laughing. Besides, the Emperor wasn't simply at death's door, but, well, inside the hallway, admiring the carpet and commenting on the hat stand. And you didn't have to be a political genius to know that when someone like that died, scores were being settled before he'd even got cold. Anyone he'd publicly called a friend would have a life expectancy more normally associated with things that hover over trout streams at sunset. Rincewind moved aside a skull and sat down. There was the possibility of rescue, he supposed, but the Red Army would be hard put to it to rescue a rubber duck from drowning. Anyway, that had put him back in the clutches of Butterfly, who terrified him almost as much as the Emperor. He had to believe that the gods didn't intend for Rincewind, after all his adventures, to rot in a dungeon. No, he added bitterly. They probably had something much more inventive in mind. What light reached the dungeon came from a very small grill and had a second-hand look. The rest of the furnishing was a pile of what had possibly once been straw. There was... A gentle tapping on the wall. Once, twice, three times. Rincewind picked up the skull and returned the signal. One tap came back. He repeated it. Then there were two. He tapped twice. Well, this was familiar. Communication without meaning. It was just like being back at Unseen University. Fine, he said, his voice echoing in the cell. Fine. Trey prisoner. But what are we saying? There was a gentle scraping noise, and one of the blocks in the wall very gently slid out of the wall, dropping onto Rincewind's foot. Ah! What big hippo? said a muffled voice. What? Sorry. What? You wanted to know about the tapping code. It's how we communicate between cells, you see. One tap means... Excuse me, but aren't we communicating now? Yes, but not formally. Prisoners are not allowed to talk. The voice slowed down, as if the speaker had suddenly remembered something important. Ah, yes, said Rincewind. I was forgetting. This is hung-hung. Everyone obeys the rules. Rincewind's voice died away, too. On either side of the wall there was a long, thoughtful silence. Rincewind? Two flower? What are you doing here? said Rincewind. Rotting in a dungeon. Me too. Good grief! 
How long has it been? said the muffled voice of Two Flower. What? How long has what been? But you! Why are you? You wrote that damn book! I just thought it would be interesting for people. Interesting? Interesting? I thought people would find it an interesting account of a foreign culture. I never meant it to cause trouble. Rincewind leaned against his side of the wall. No, of course. Two Flower never wanted to cause any trouble. Some people never did. Probably the last sound heard before the universe folded up like a paper hat would be someone saying, What happens if I do this? It must have been fate that brought you here, said Two Flower. Yes, it's the sort of thing he likes to do, said Rincewind. You remember the good times we had? Did we? I must have had my eyes shut. The adventures? Oh, them. You mean hanging from high places, that sort of thing. Rincewind? Yes, what? I feel a lot happier about things now you're here. That's amazing. Rincewind enjoyed the comfort of the wall. It was just rock. He felt he could rely on it. Everyone seems to have a copy of your book, he said. It's a revolutionary document, and I do mean copy. It looks as if they make their own copy and pass it on. Yes, it's called Sammy's Dat. What does that mean? It means each one must be the same as the one before. Oh dear, I thought it would just be entertainment. I didn't think people would take it seriously. I do hope it's not causing too much bother. Well, your revolutionaries are still at the slogan and poster stage, but I shouldn't think that'll count for much if they're caught. Oh dear. How come you're still alive? I don't know. I think they may have forgotten about me. That tends to happen, you know. It's the paperwork. Someone makes the wrong stroke with the brush, or forgets to copy a line. I believe it happens a lot. You mean there's people in prison and no one can remember why? Oh, yes. Then why don't they set them free? I suppose it's felt they must have done something. All in all, I'm afraid our government does leave something to be desired. Like a new government? Oh, dear. You could get locked up for saying things like that. People slept, but the Forbidden City never slept. Torches flickered all night in the great bureau as the ceaseless business of empire went on. This largely involved, as Mr. Savoy had said, moving paper. Six Beneficent Winds was a deputy district administrator for the Langtang district, and good at a job which he rather enjoyed. He was not a wicked man. True, he had the same sense of humour as a chicken casserole, True, he played the accordion for amusement, and disliked cats intensely, and had a habit of dabbing his upper lip with his napkin after his tea ceremony, in a way that had made Mrs. Beneficent Winds commit murder in her mind on a regular basis over the years. And he kept his money in a small leather shovel purse, and counted it out very thoroughly whenever he made a purchase, especially if there was a queue behind him. But on the other hand, he was kind to animals, and made small but regular contributions to charity. He frequently gave moderate sums to beggars in the street, although he made a note of this in the little notebook he always carried to remind him to visit them in his official capacity later on. And he never took away from people more money than they actually had. He was also, unusually for men employed in the Forbidden City after dark, not a eunuch. Guards were not eunuchs, of course, and people had got around this by classifying them officially as furniture and it had been found that tax officials also needed every faculty at their disposal to combat the wiles of the average peasant, who had this regrettable tendency to avoid paying taxes. There were much nastier people in the building than six beneficent winds, and it was therefore just his inauspicious luck that his paper and bamboo door slid aside to reveal seven strange-looking old eunuchs, one of them in a wheeled contrivance. They didn't even bow, let alone fall on their knees, and he not only had an official red hat, but it had a white button on it. His brush dropped from his hands when the men wandered into his office as if they owned it. One of them started poking holes in the wall and speaking gibberish. Hey, the walls are just made of paper. Hey, look, if you lick your finger, it goes right through, see? I will call for the guards and have you all flogged shouted six beneficent winds, his temper moderated slightly by the extreme age of the visitors. What did he say? He said he'd call for the guards. Oh, yes, please let him call for the guards. 
No, we don't want that yet. Act normally. You mean cut his throat? I meant a more normal kind of normally. It's what I call normal. One of the old men faced the speechless official and gave him a big grin. Excuse us, your supreme. Um, oh dear, what's the word? Um, push cart sale? Uh, uh, immense rock? Uh, oh, ah, yes, venerableness. But we seem to be a little lost. A couple of the old men shuffled around behind six beneficent winds and started to read, or at least try to read, what he'd been working on. A sheet of paper was snatched from his hands. What's this say, Teach? Let me see. The first wind of autumn shakes the lotus flower. Seven lucky logs to pay one pig, and three looks like a four-armed man waving a flag of rice. On pain of having his rather a stylized thing here, can't quite make it out. Struck with many blows, by order of six beneficent winds, collector of revenues, Lang Tang. There was a subtle change among the old men. Now they were all grinning, but not in a way that gave him any comfort. One of them, with teeth like diamonds, leaned towards him and said, in bad Agatian, "You're a tax collector." Mr. Knob on your hat. Six beneficent winds wondered if he'd be able to summon the guard. There was something terrible about these old men. They weren't venerable at all. They were horribly menacing. And although he couldn't see any obvious weapons, he knew for a cold, frozen fact that he wouldn't be able to get out more than the first syllable before he'd be killed. Besides, his throat had gone dry and his pants had gone wet. Nothing wrong with being a tax collector, he croaked. We never said that," said Diamond Teeth. "We always like to meet tax collectors. Some of our most favouritest people, tax collectors," said another old man. "Saves a lot of trouble," said Diamond Teeth. "Yeah," said a third old man. "Like it means you don't have to go from house to house killing everyone for their valuables. You just wait and kill the gentleman. Can I have a word?" The speaker was the slightly goat-faced one that didn't seem quite so unpleasant as the others. The terrible men clustered around him, and sick, beneficent winds heard the strange syllables of a coarse foreign tongue. What? But he's a tax collector. That's what they're for. What? A firm tax base is the foundation of sound governance, gentlemen. Please trust me. I understood all of that up to a firm. Tax. Nevertheless, no useful purpose will be served by killing this hard-working tax gatherer. He'd be dead. I call that useful. There was some more of the same. Six beneficent winds jumped when the group broke up, and the goat-faced man gave him a smile. My humble friends are overawed by your. A variety of plum, um, um, uh, small knife for cutting seaweed, um, presents, noble sir," he said. His every word slandered by Truckle's vigorous gesticulation behind his back. How about if we just cut a bit off? What? How did you get in here? Said six beneficent winds. There are many strong guards. I knew we missed something," said Diamond Teeth. "We would like you to show us around the Forbidden City," said Goatface. "My name is Mister Stuffed Tube. I think you would call it. Yes, Stuffed Tube. I'm pretty sure." Six beneficent winds glanced hopefully towards the door, and we are here to learn more about your wonderful mountain. Um. Uh, variety of bamboo.、Uh, sound of running water at evening. Right.、Um, uh, civilization. Behind him, Truckle was energetically demonstrating to the rest of the horde what he and Bruce the Hoon's skeletal raiders once did to a tax gatherer. The sweeping arm movements, in particular, occupied six beneficent winds' attention. He couldn't understand the words, but somehow you didn't need to. Why are you talking to him like that? Genghis, I'm lost. There are no maps of the Forbidden City. We need a guide. Goatface, 
turned back to the taxman. Perhaps you would like to come with us, he said. Out, thought six beneficent winds. Yes, there may be guards out there. Just a minute, said Diamond Teeth as he nodded. Pick up your paintbrush and write down what I say. A minute later they'd gone. All that remained in the taxman's office was an amended piece of paper which read as follows. Roses are red, violets are blue, seven lucky logs to be given one pig and all the rice he can carry because he is now one lucky peasant. By order of six beneficent winds, collector of revenues, Lang Tang. Help, help, if anyone reads this, I am being held prisoner by an evil eunuch. Help. Rincewind and Two Flower lay in their separate cells and talked about the good old days. At least Two Flower talked about the good old days. Rincewind worked at a crack in the stone with a piece of straw, it being all he had to hand. It would take several thousand years to make any kind of impression, but that was no reason to give up. Do we get fed in here? he said, interrupting the flow of reminiscence. Oh, sometimes, but it's not like the marvellous food in Ark Moorpork. Really? murmured Rincewind, scratching away. A tiny piece of mortar seemed ready to move. I'll always remember the taste of Mr. Dibbler's sausages. People do. A once-in-a-lifetime experience. Frequently. The straw broke. Damn and blast! Rincewind sat back. What's so important about the Red Army? he said. I mean, they're just a bunch of kids. Just a nuisance. Yes, I'm afraid things got rather confused, said Two Flower. Um, have you ever heard of the theory that history goes in cycles? Well, I saw a drawing in one of Leonard of Quirm's notebooks, Rincewind began, trying again with another straw. No, I mean like a, a wheel spinning. If you stand in the same place, it all comes round again. Oh, that. Blast! Well, a lot of people believe it here. They think history starts again every three thousand years. Could be, said Rincewind, who was looking for another straw and wasn't really listening. Then the words sank in. Three thousand years? That's a bit short, isn't it? The whole thing? Stars and oceans and intelligent life evolving from arts graduates? That sort of thing? Oh no, that's just stuff. Proper history started with the founding of the empire by one son Mira, the first emperor, and his servant, the great wizard. Just a legend, really. It's the sort of thing peasants believe. They look at something like the Great Wall and say, that's such a marvellous thing it must have been built by magic. And the Red Army, what it probably was, was just a well-organised body of trained fighting men. The first real army, you see. All there was before was just undisciplined mobs. That's what it must have been. Not magical at all. The Great Wizard couldn't really have made... <sighs> what the peasants believe is silly. Why? What do they believe? They say the great wizard made the earth come alive. When all the armies on the continent faced one sun mirror, the great wizard flew a kite. Sounds sensible to me, said Rincewind. When there's a war around, take the day off. That's my motto. No, you don't understand. This was a special kite. It trapped the lightning in the sky, and the great wizard stored it in bottles, and then took the mud itself, and baked it with the lightning, and made it into an army. Never heard of any spells for that. And they have funny ideas about reincarnation, too. Rincewind conceded that they probably would. It probably wiled away those long water buffaloid hours. Hey, after I die, I hope I come back as a man holding a water buffalo, but facing a different way. Um, no, said Two Flower. They don't think you can come back at all. Uh, oh, I'm not using the right words, am I? Bit corroded on this language. I mean... Pre-incarnation. It's like reincarnation backwards. They think you're born before you die. Oh, really, said Rincewind, scratching at the stones. Amazing. Born before you die. Life before death. People will get really excited when they hear about that. No, that's not exactly... Uh, it's all tied in with ancestors. You should always venerate ancestors because you might be them one day. And... Are you listening? The little piece of mortar fell away. Not bad for ten minutes' work, thought Rincewind. Come the next ice age, we're out of here. It dawned on him that he was working on the wall that led to Two Flowers' cell. Taking several thousand years to break into an adjoining cell could well be thought of as a waste of time. 
He started on a different wall. Scratch, scratch. There was a terrible scream. Scratch, 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 scratch. Sounds like the Emperor has woken up, said Two Flowers' voice from the hole in the wall. That's kind of an early morning torture, is it? said Rincewind. He started to hammer at the huge blocks with a piece of shattered stone. It's not really his fault. He just doesn't understand about people. Is that so? You know how common kids go through a stage of pulling the wings off flies? I never did, said Rincewind. You can't trust flies. They may look small, but they can turn nasty. Kids generally, I mean. Yes. Well? He is an emperor. No one ever dared tell him it was wrong. It's just a matter of, you know, scaling up. All the five families fight among themselves for the crown. He killed his nephew to become emperor. No one has ever told him that it's not right to keep killing people for fun. At least no one who has ever managed to get to the end of the first sentence. And the Hongs and the Fangs and the Tangs and the Sungs and the McSweenies have been killing one another for thousands of years. It's all part of the royal succession. McSweenies? Very old established family. Rincewind nodded gloomily. It was probably like breeding horses. If you have a system where treacherous murderers tend to win, you end up breeding really treacherous murderers. You end up with a situation where it's dangerous to lean over a cradle. There was another scream. Rincewind started kicking at the stones. A key turned in the lock. Oh, said Two Flower. But the door didn't open. Finally, Rincewind walked over and tried the big iron ring. The door swung outwards, but not too far because the recumbent body of a guard makes an unusual but efficient doorstop. There was a whole ring of keys hanging from the one in the door. An inexperienced prisoner would simply have run for it, but Rincewind was a postgraduate student in the art of staying alive and knew that in circumstances like these much the best thing to do was let out every single prisoner, pat each one hurriedly on the back and say, quick, they're coming for you and then go and sit somewhere nice and quiet until the pursuit had disappeared in the distance. He opened the door to Two Flowers' cell first. The little man was skinnier and grubbier than he remembered, and had a wispy beard, but in one very significant way he had the feature that Rincewind remembered so well, the big, beaming, trusting smile that suggested that anything bad currently happening to him was just some sort of laughable mistake and would be bound to be sorted out by reasonable people. Rincewind, it is you. I certainly never thought I'd see you again, he said. Yes, I thought something on those lines, said Rincewind. Two Flower looked past Rincewind at the fallen guard. Is he dead? he said, speaking of a man with a sword half buried in his back. Extremely likely. Did you do that? I was inside the cell. Amazing. Good trick. Despite several years of exposure to the facts of the matter, Rincewind remembered Two Flower had never really wanted to grasp the fact that his companion had the magical abilities of the common housefly. It was useless to try and dissuade him. It just meant that modesty was added to the list of non-existent virtues. He tried some of the keys in other cell doors. Various raggedy people emerged, blinking in the slightly better light. One of them, turning his body slightly in order to get it through the door, was three yoked oxen. From the look of him, he'd been beaten up, but this might just have been someone's attempt to attract his attention. This is Rincewind, said Two Flower proudly, the great wizard. Did you know he killed the guard from inside the cell? They politely inspected the corpse. I didn't, really, said Rincewind. And he's modest, too. Long life to the people's endeavour, said three yoked oxen through rather swollen lips. Mine's a pint said Rincewind. Here's big fella keys belong door. You go letty people out, he chop chop. One of the freed prisoners limped to the end of the passage. There's a dead guard here, he said. It wasn't me, said Rincewind plaintively. I mean, perhaps I wish they were dead, but... People edged away. You didn't want to be too close to anyone who could wish like that. If this had been Ankh Morpork, somebody would have said, Oh, yeah, sure, he magically stabbed them in the back. But that was because people in Ankh Morpork knew Rincewind, and they knew that if a wizard really wanted you dead, you'd have no back left to stab. Three yoked oxen had been able to master the technical business of opening doors. More swung open. Lotus Blossom, said Rincewind. 
She clung to Oxen's arm and smiled at Rincewind. Other members of the cadre trooped out behind her. Then, to Rincewind's amazement, she looked at Two Flower, screamed, and threw her arms around his neck. Extended continuation to filial affection, chanted three yoked Oxen. Close cover before striking, said Rincewind. Um, what exactly is happening? A very small red soldier tugged at his robe. He is her daddy, it said. You never said you had children. I'm sure I did, often, said Two Flower, disentangling himself. Anyway, it is allowed. You're married? I was, yes. I'm sure I must have said. We were probably running away from something at the time, so there's a Mrs. Two Flower, is there? There was for a while, said Two Flower, and for a moment an expression almost of anger distorted his preternaturally benign countenance. Not alas any more. Rincewind looked away, because that was better than looking at Two Flower's face. Butterfly had also emerged. She stood just outside the cell door, with her hands clasped in front of her, looking down demurely at her feet. Two Flower rushed over to her. Butterfly! Rincewind looked down at the rabbit clutcher. She another daughter, Pearl. Yes. The little man came towards Rincewind, dragging the girls. Have you met my daughters, he said. This is Rincewind, who... We have had the pleasure, said Butterfly gravely. How did you all get here, said Rincewind. We fought as hard as we could, said Butterfly, but there were simply too many of them. I hope you didn't try to grab their weapons, said Rincewind, as sarcastically as he dared. Butterfly glared at him. Sorry, said Rincewind. Herb says it is the system that is to blame, said Lotus Blossom. I bet he's got a better system all worked out. Rincewind looked at the throng of prisoners. They usually have. Where is he, by the way? The girls looked around. I don't see him here, said Lotus Blossom, but I think that when the guards attacked us, he laid down his life for the cause. Why? Because that's what he said we should do. I am ashamed that I did not, but they seemed to want to capture us, not kill us. I did not see him, said Butterfly. She and Rincewind exchanged a glance. I think perhaps he was not there. You mean he had been caught already? said Lotus Blossom. Butterfly looked at Rincewind again. It occurred to him that whereas Lotus Blossom had inherited a two-flower view of the world, Butterfly must have taken after her mother. She thought more like Rincewind, i.e. the worst of everyone. Perhaps, she said. Make considerable sacrifice for the common good, said three yoked oxen. There's one born every minute, said Rincewind absently. Butterfly seemed to get a grip of herself. However, she said, we must make the most of this opportunity. Rincewind, who had been heading for the stairs, froze. Exactly what do you mean, he said. Don't you see, we are at large in the Forbidden City. Not me, said Rincewind. I've never been at large. I've always been at hunched. The enemy brought us in here, and now we are free. Thanks to the great wizard, said Lotus Blossom, and we must seize the day. She picked up a sword from a stricken guard and waved it dramatically. We must storm the palace, just as Herb suggested. There's only thirty of you, said Rincewind. You're not a storm, you're a shower. There are hardly any guards within the city itself, said Butterfly. If we can overcome those around the Emperor's apartments. You'll be killed, said Rincewind. She turned on him. Then at least we shall have died for something. Cleanse the state with the blood of the martyrs, rumbled three yoked oxen. Rincewind spun round and waved a finger under three yoked oxen's nose, which was as high as he could reach. I'll bloody well thump you if you trot out something like that one more time, he shouted, and then grimaced at the realisation that he had just threatened a man three times heavier than he was. Listen to me, will you, he said, settling down a little. I know about people who talk about suffering for the common good. It's never bloody them. When you hear a man shouting, forward, brave comrades, you'll see he's the one behind the bloody big rock and wearing the only really arrow-proof helmet. Understand? He stopped. The cadre were looking at him as if he were mad. He stared at their young, keen faces and felt very, very old.
But there are causes worth dying for," said Butterfly. "No, there aren't, because you've only got one life. But you can pick up another five causes on any street corner." Good grief! How can you live with a philosophy like that? Rincewind took a deep breath. Continuously, six beneficent winds had thought it was a pretty good plan. The horrible old men were lost in the Forbidden City. Although they had a wiry look, rather like natural bonsai trees that had managed to flourish on a windswept cliff, they were nevertheless very old, and not at all heavily armed. So he led them in the direction of the gymnasium, and when they were inside, he screamed for help at the top of his voice. To his amazement, they didn't turn and run. "Can we kill him now?" said Truckle. A couple of dozen muscular men had stopped pounding logs of wood and piles of bricks and were regarding them suspiciously. "Got any ideas?" said Cohen to Mr. Savaloy. "Oh dear, they're so very tough looking, aren't they? You can't think of anything civilized? No, it's over to you, I'm afraid." "Ah ha! I've been waiting for this," said Caleb, pushing forward. "Been practicing every day, you know." With my big lump of teak. These are ninjas," said Six Beneficent Winds proudly, as a couple of the men wandered towards the door and pulled it shut. The finest fighters in the world, yield now. That's interesting," said Cohen. "Here, you in the black pajamas, just got out of bed, have you? Who's the best out of all of you?" One of the men stared fixedly at Cohen and thrust out a hand at the nearest wall. It left a dent. Then he nodded at the tax gatherer. What are these old fools you brought us? I think they're barbarian invaders," said the taxman. How do you? How did he know that? Said Boy Willie. We're wearing itchy trousers and eating with forks and everything. The leading ninja sneered. Heroic eunuchs," he said. Old men, who are you calling a eunuch? Cohen demanded. Can I just show him what I've been practicing with my lump of teak? Said Caleb, hopping arthritically from one foot to another. The ninja eyed the slab of timber. You could not make a dent on that old man, he said. You watch," said Caleb. He held out the wood at arm's length. Then he raised his other hand, grunting a little as it got past shoulder height. You're watching this hand. You're watching this hand," he demanded. "I am watching," said the ninja, trying not to laugh. "Good," said Caleb. He kicked the man squarely in the groin, and then, as he doubled up, hit him over the head with the teak. "Cause you should have been watching this foot." And that would have been all there was to it if there had only been one ninja. But there was a clatter of rice flails and an unsheathing of long, curved swords. The horde drew close together. Hamish pushed back his rug to reveal their armory. Although the collection of notched blades looked positively homely compared with the shiny toys ranged against them. Teach, why don't you take Mister Taxman over to the corner, out of harm's way? Said Genghis. This is madness," said Six Beneficent Winds. "They're the finest fighters in the world, and you are just old men. Give in now, and I'll see if I can get you a rebate." Calm down, calm down," said Mister Savaloy. "No one's going to get hurt, metaphorically at least." Genghis Cohen waved his sword a few times. "Okay, you lads," he said. "Give us your best ninji." Six beneficent winds looked on in horror as the horde squared up. "But it will be a terrible slaughter," he said. "I'm afraid so," said Mister Savaloy. He fished in his pockets for a bag of peppermints. Who are these mad old men? What do they do? Barbarian heroing, generally," said Mister Savaloy. "Rescuing princesses, robbing temples, fighting monsters, exploring ancient and terror-filled ruins—that sort of thing. But they look old enough to be dead. Why do they do it?" Savaloy shrugged. "That's all they've ever done." A ninja somersaulted down the room, screaming, a sword in either hand. Cohen waited in an attitude rather similar to that of a baseball batter. I wonder," said Mr. Savaloy, "if you've ever heard of the term evolution." The two met. The air blurred. Or 
Survival of the fittest, said Mr. Saveloy. The scream continued, but rather more urgently. I didn't even see his sword move, whispered six beneficent winds. Yes, people often don't, said Mr. Saveloy. But they're so old. Indeed, said the teacher, raising his voice above the screams. And of course this is true, they are very old barbarian heroes. The taxman stared. Would you like a peppermint? said Mr. Savaloy, as Hamish's wheelchair thundered past in pursuit of a man with a broken sword and a pressing desire to stay alive. You may find it helps if you are around the horde for any length of time. The aroma from the proffered paper bag hit six beneficent winds like a flamethrower. How can you smell anything after eating those? You can't, said Mr. Savaloy happily. The taxman continued to stare. The fighting was a fast and furious affair, but somehow only on one side. The horde fought like you'd expect old men to fight, slowly and with care. All the activity was on the part of the ninjas, but no matter how well flung the throwing star or speedy the kick, the target was always, without any obvious effort, not there. Since we have this moment to chat, said Mr. Savaloy, as something with a lot of blades hit the wall just above the taxman's head. I wonder, could you tell me about the big hill just outside the city? It is quite a remarkable feature. What? said Six Beneficent Winds distractedly. The big hill. You want to know about that now? Geography is a little hobby of mine. Someone's ear hit Six Beneficent Winds on the ear. Ah, uh, what? Uh, we call it the big hill. Hey, look at what he's doing with his... It seems remarkably regular. Is it a, a natural feature? What? Uh, oh, I don't know. They say it turned up thousands of years ago, during a terrible storm, when the first emperor died. He He's going to be killed. He's going to be killed. He, how did he do that? Six beneficent winds suddenly remembered as a child playing Shibo Yang Kong San with his grandfather. The old man always won. No matter how carefully he'd assembled his strategy, he'd find grandfather would place a tile quite innocently right in the crucial place just before he could make his big move. The ancestor had spent his whole life playing Shibo. The fight was just like that. Oh, my, he said. That's right, said Mr. Savaloy. They've had a lifetime's experience of not dying. They've become very good at it. But why here? Why come here? We're going to undertake a robbery, said Mr. Savaloy. Six beneficent winds nodded sagely. The wealth of the Forbidden City was legendary. Probably even blood-sucking ghosts had heard of it. The talking vase of Emperor Pjisu? he said. No. The jade head of Sung Tsuit Li? No. Wrong track entirely, I'm afraid. Not the secret of how silk is made. Good grief. Silkworms bottoms. Everyone knows that. No, something rather more precious than that. Despite himself, Six Beneficent Winds was impressed. Apart from anything else, only seven ninjas were still standing, and Cohen was fencing with one of them while rolling a cigarette in the other hand. And Mr. Savaloy could see it dawning in the fat man's eyes. The same thing had happened to him. Cohen came into people's lives like a rogue planet into a peaceful solar system, and you felt yourself being dragged along simply because nothing like that would ever happen to you again. He himself had been peacefully hunting for fossils during the school holidays when he'd more or less stumbled into the camp of those particular fossils called the Horde. They'd been quite friendly because he had neither weapons nor money, and they'd taken to him because he knew things they didn't. And that had been it. He'd decided there and then. It must have been something in the air. His past life had suddenly unrolled behind him, and he couldn't remember a single day of it that had been any fun. And it had dawned on him that he could join the Horde or go back to school, and pretty soon a limp handshake, a round of applause, and his pension. It was something about Cohen. Maybe it was what they called charisma. It overpowered even his normal smell of a goat that had just eaten curried asparagus. 
He did everything wrong. He cursed people and used what Mr. Savaloy considered very offensive language to foreigners. He shouted terms that would have earned anyone else a free slit throat from a variety of interesting ethnic weapons. And he got away with it. Partly because it was clear that there was no actual malice there, but mainly because he was, well, Cohen. A sort of basic natural force on legs. It worked on everything. When he wasn't actually fighting them, he got on a lot better with trolls than did people who merely thought that trolls had rights, just like everyone else. Even the horde, bloody-minded individualists to a man, fell for it. But Mr. Savaloy had also seen the aimlessness in their lives, and one night he'd brought the conversation round to the opportunities offered in the Aurient. There was a light in Six Beneficent Wind's expression. Have you got... An accountant, he said. Well, um, no, as a matter of fact. Will this theft be treated as income or capital? I haven't really thought of it like that. The horde doesn't pay taxes. What? Not to anyone? No, it's funny, but they never seem to keep their money for long. It seems to disappear on drink and women and high living. I suppose from a heroing point of view, they may count as taxes. There was a pop as six beneficent winds uncorked a small bottle of ink and licked his writing brush. But those sort of things probably count as allowable expenses for the barbarian hero he said. They are part of the job specification. And then, of course, there is wear and tear on weaponry, protective clothing. They could certainly claim for at least one new loincloth a year. I don't think they've claimed for one per century. And there's pensions, of course. Ah, don't use that word. They think it's a dirty word. But in a way, that is what they're here for. This is their last adventure. When they've stolen this very valuable thing that you won't tell me about, that's right, you'd be very welcome to join us. You could, perhaps, be a barbarian, um, to push beans. Oh, uh, a length of knotted string. Oh, uh, accountant. Have you ever killed anyone? Not outright, but I've always thought you could do considerable damage with a well-placed final demand. Mr. Savaloy beamed. Ah, yes, he said. Civilization. The last ninja was upright, but only just. Hamish had run his wheelchair over his foot. Mr. Savaloy patted the taxman's arm. Excuse me, he said. I find I often have to intervene at this stage. He padded over to the surviving man, who was looking around wildly. Six swords had become interlaced around his neck, as though he'd taken part in a rather energetic folk dance. Good morning said Mr. Savaloy. I should just point out that Genghis here is, despite appearances, a remarkably honest man. He finds it hard to understand empty bravura. May I venture to suggest, therefore, that you refrain from phrases like I would rather die than betray my emperor, or go ahead and do your worst, unless you really, really mean them. Should you wish for mercy, a simple hand signal will suffice. I strongly advise you not to attempt to nod. The young man looked sideways at Cohen, who gave him an encouraging smile. Then he waved a hand quickly. The swords unwove. Truckle hit the ninja overhead with a club. It's all right. You don't have to go on about it. I didn't kill him, he said sulkily. Ow! Boy Willie had been experimenting with a rice flail and had hit his own ear. How'd they manage to fight with this rubbish? What? These little hogs watch decoration thingies look the business, though, said Vincent, picking up a throwing star. Ugh, he sucked his fingers. Useless foreign junk. That bit where that lad sprang backwards right across the room with them axes in his hands was impressive, though. Yeah. You didn't ought to have stuck your sword out like that, I thought. He's learned an important lesson. It won't do him much good now where he's gone. What? Six beneficent winds was half laughing, half shocked. But, but 
I've seen these guards fight before, he said. They're invincible. No one told us. But you beat them all. Yup. And you're just eunuchs. There was a scrape of steel. Six beneficent winds closed his eyes. He could feel metal touching his neck in at least five places. Oh, there's that word again, said the voice of Cohen the Barbarian. But you're dressed as eunuchs, murmured Six Beneficent Winds, trying not to swallow. Mr. Savaloy backed away, chuckling nervously. You see, he said, speaking fast, you're too old to be taken for guards, and you don't look like bureaucrats, so I thought it would be... Uh, <laughs> A very good disguise to eunuch, roared Truckle. You mean people have been looking at me and thinking I mince around saying, Hell you owe Celtet? Like many men whose testosterone had always sloshed out of their ears, the Horde had never fine-tuned their approach to the more complex areas of sexuality. A teacher to the core, Mr. Savaloy couldn't help correcting them, even at sword point. Uh, that means... The glutton dances, not as you seem to think, hello, sailor, which is heos nauta, he said, and eunuchs don't say it, not as a matter of course. Look, it, it's an honour to be a eunuch in the Forbidden City. Many of them occupy very exalted positions in... Then prepare yourself for high office, teacher, Truckle shouted. Cohen knocked the sword out of his hand. All right, none of that. I don't like it either, he said. But it's just a disguise. Shouldn't mean anything to a man who once bit a bear's head off, should it? Yeah, but, you know, it's not... I mean, when we went past those young ladies back there, they all giggled. Maybe later you can find them and make them laugh, said Cohen. But you should have told us, Teach. Sorry. What? What's he say? He said you're a eunuch, Boy Willie bellowed in Hamish's ear. Yeah, said Hamish happily. What? That's me, the one and only. No, he didn't mean... What? Oh, never mind, it's all pretty much the same to you, Hamish. Mr. Savaloy surveyed the wrecked gym. I wonder what time it is, he said. Ah, gurgled six beneficent winds, happy to lighten things a little. Here, you know we have an amazing demon-powered device that tells you what the time is even when the sun isn't... Clocks, said Mr. Savaloy. We've got them in Ark Moorpork. Only demons evaporate eventually, so now they work by... He paused. Interesting. You don't have a word for it. Uh, shaped metal that does work? Um, toothed wheels? The taxman looked frightened. Wheels with teeth? What do you call the things that grind corn? Peasants. Yes, but uh, what do they grind corn with? I don't know. Why should I know? Only peasants need to know that. Yes. I suppose that says it all, really, said Mr. Savaloy sadly. It's a long way off dawn, said Truckle. Why don't we go and kill everyone in their beds? No, 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 said Mr. Savaloy. I keep telling you, we've got to do it properly. I could show you the treasure house, said Six Beneficent Winds helpfully. Never a good idea to give a monkey the key to a banana plantation said Mr. Savaloy. Can you think of anything else to keep them amused for an hour? Down in the basement there was a man who was talking about the government at the top of his voice. You can't fight for a cause. A cause is just a thing. Then we are fighting for the peasants, said Butterfly. She'd backed away. Rinswin's anger was coming off him like steam. Oh, have you ever met them? I... Have seen them. Oh, good. And what is it you want to achieve? A better life for the people, said Butterfly coldly. 
You think you having some uprising and hanging a few people will do it? Well, I come from Ark Morpork, and we've had more rebellions and civil wars than you've had lukewarm duck's feet. And you know what? The rulers are still in charge. They always are. They smiled at him in polite and nervous incomprehension. Look, he said, rubbing his forehead, all those people out in the fields, the water buffalo people. If you have a revolution, it'll be all the better for them, will it? Of course, said Butterfly. They will no longer be subject to the cruel and capricious whims of the Forbidden City. No, oh, that's good, said Rincewind. So they'll sort of be in charge of themselves, will they? Indeed, said Lotus Blossom. By means of the People's Committee, said Butterfly. Rincewind pressed both hands to his head. My word, he said. I don't know why, but I had this predictive flash. They looked impressed. I had this sudden feeling, he went on, that there won't be all that many water buffalo string holders on the People's Committee. In fact, I get this kind of voice telling me that a lot of the People's Committee, correct me if I'm wrong, are standing in front of me right now. Initially, of course, said Butterfly. The peasants can't even read and write. I expect they don't even know how to farm properly, said Rincewind gloomily. Not after doing it for only three or four thousand years. We certainly believe that there are many improvements that could be made, yes, said Butterfly, if we act collectively. I bet they'll be really glad when you show them, said Rincewind. He stared glumly at the floor. He quite liked the job of a water buffalo string holder. It sounded nearly as good as the profession of castaway. He longed for the kind of life when you could really concentrate on the squishiness of the mud underfoot and make up pictures in the clouds. The kind of life where you could let your mind catch up with you and speculate for hours at a time about when your water buffalo was next going to enrich the loam. But it was probably difficult enough as it was without people trying to improve it. He wanted to say, how can you be so nice and yet so dumb? The best thing you can do with the peasants is leave them alone. Let them get on with it. When people who can read and write start fighting on behalf of people who can't, you just end up with another kind of stupidity. If you want to help them, build a big library or something somewhere, and leave the door open. But this is Hung Hung. You can't think like that in Hung Hung. This is where people have learned to do what they're told. The Horde worked that one out. The Empire's got something worse than whips all right. It's got obedience. Whips in the soul. They obey anyone who tells them what to do. Freedom just means being told what to do by someone different. You'll all be killed. I'm a coward, and even I know more about fights than you do. I've run away from some really good ones. Oh, let's just get out of here, he said. He gingerly took the sword from a dead guard and held it the right way round on the second attempt. He weighed it for a second, then shook his head and threw it away. The cadre looked a lot happier. But I'm not leading you, said Rincewind. I'm just showing you the way. And it's the way out. Do you understand? They stood wearing rather bruised looks, as people do who've been subject to several minutes ranting. No one spoke, until Two Flower whispered, He often goes on like this, you know, and then he does something very brave. Rincewind snorted. There was another dead guard at the top of the stairs. Sudden death seemed to be catching. And leaning against the wall was a bundle of swords. Tied to it was a scroll. The great wizard has shown us the way for only two minutes, and already we have extra luck, said Lotus Blossom. Don't touch the swords, said Rincewind. But supposing we see more guards, should we not resist them with every drop of our life's blood, said Butterfly. Rincewind looked blank. No. Run away. Ah, yes, said Two Flower, and live to fight another day. That is an Ankh Morpork saying. Rincewind had always assumed that the purpose of running away was to be able to run away another day. However, he said, people don't usually find themselves mysteriously let out of prison with a bunch of weapons handily close by and all the guards out of action. Ever thought of that? And with a map, said Butterfly. Her eyes shone. She flourished the scroll. It's a map of the way out, said Rincewind. No, to the Emperor's chambers. Look, it has been marked. That's what Herb used to talk about sometimes. He must be in the palace. 
We should assassinate the emperor. More luck, said Two Flower. But look, you know, I'm sure if we talked to him, haven't you been listening? We are not going to see the emperor, hissed Rincewind. Does it occur to you that guards don't stab themselves? Cells don't suddenly become unlocked? You don't find swords lying around so conveniently, and you don't, you really don't find maps saying, this way, folks. And anyway, you can't talk to someone who's a plate of prawn crackers short of a set meal A for two. No, said Butterfly, we must make the most of this opportunity. There will be lots of guards. Well, great wizard, you will have a lot of wishing to do. You think I can snap my fingers like this and all the guards would drop dead? Huh, I wish they would. These two out here have, Lotus Blossom reported from the entrance to the dungeons. She was already in awe of Rincewind. Now she looked positively terrified. Coincidence. Let's be serious, said Butterfly. We have a sympathizer in the palace. Perhaps it is someone risking their lives every moment. We know some of the eunuchs are on our side. They've got nothing left to lose, I suppose. You have a better idea, Great Wizard? Yes, back into the cells. What? This smells wrong. Would you really kill the Emperor? I mean, really? Butterfly hesitated. We've often talked about it. Two fire herbs said that if we could assassinate the Emperor... We would light the torch of freedom. Yes, it'll be you burning. Look, get back in the cells. It's the safest place. I'll lock you in and scout. That's a very brave suggestion, said Too Far, and typical of the man, he added proudly. Butterfly gave Rincewind a look he'd come to dread. It is a good idea, she said, and I will accompany you. Oh, but it's bound to be very dangerous said Rincewind quickly. No harm can possibly come to me when I am with the great wizard, said Butterfly. Very true, very true, said Two Flower. No harm ever came to me, I know that. Besides, his daughter went on, I have the map, and it would be dreadful if you lost your way and accidentally strayed out of the Forbidden City, wouldn't it? Rincewind gave in. It struck him that Two Flower's late wife must have been a remarkably intelligent woman. Oh, all right, he said, but you're not to get in the way, and you're to do what I tell you, okay? Butterfly bowed. Lead on, oh great wizard, she said. I knew it, said Truckle. Poison. No, no, you don't eat it. You rub it on your body, said Mr. Savaloy. Watch. And you get what we in civilization call clean. Most of the horde stood waist deep in the warm water, every man with his hands chastely wrapped around his body. Hamish had refused to relinquish his wheelchair, so only his head was above the surface. It's all prickly, said Cohen, and my skin's peeling off and dissolving. That's not skin, said Mr. Savaloy. Haven't any of you seen a bath before? Oh, I've seen one, said Boy Willie. I killed the mad Bishop of Pseudopolis in one. You get, um, he furrowed his brow, your bubbles and stuff. And fifteen naked maidens. What? Definitely fifteen. <laughs> Remember it well. That's more like it, said Caleb. All we've got to rub is this... Soap stuff. The emperor is ritually bathed by twenty-two bath women, said six beneficent winds. I could go and check with the harem eunuchs and wake them up if you like. It's probably allowable under entertaining. The taxman was warming to his new job. He'd worked out that although the horde as individuals had acquired mountains of cash in their careers as barbarian heroes, they'd lost almost all of it engaging in the other activities he mentally catalogued these as public relations, necessary to the profession, and therefore were entitled to quite a considerable rebate. The fact that they were registered with no revenue-collecting authority anywhere, except on posters with legends like, Wanted Dead, was entirely a secondary point. It was the principle that counted. 
and the interest too, of course. No, no, young women, I insist," said Mr. Savaloy. "You're having a bath to get clean. Plenty of time for young women later." Got a date when all this is over," said Caleb a little shyly, thinking wistfully of one of the few women he'd ever had a conversation with. "She's got her own farm," she said. "I could be all right for a duck." "I bet Teach don't want you to say that," said Boy Willie. "I bet he'd say you got to call it a waterfowl." <laughs> "What?" said Mad Hamish. Six beneficent winds sidled over to the teacher as the horde experimented with the bath oil, initially by drinking it. "I've worked out what it is you're going to steal," he said. "Oh yes," said Mr. Savaloy politely. He was watching Caleb, who, having had it brought home to him that he might have been adopting the wrong approach all his life, was trying to cut his nails with his sword. "It's the legendary diamond coffin of Shiz Yu," said Six Beneficent Winds. No, <laughs> wrong again. Oh, out of the baths, gentlemen," said the teacher. "I think yes, you've mastered commerce, social intercourse. <laughs> Sorry, and the principles of taxation," Mr. Savaloy went on. "Have we done that? What are they then?" said Cohen. "You take away almost all the money that the merchants have got." Said six beneficent winds, handing him a towel. Oh, is that it? I've been doing that for years. No, you've been taking away all the money," said Mr. Savaloy. "That's where you go wrong. You kill too many of them, and the ones you don't kill, you leave too poor." Sounds frightfully good to me," said Truckle, excavating the Cretaceous contents of an ear. Poor merchants. Reach us? No, 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 no. Yes, that's not civilized. It's like with sheep. Six beneficent winds explained. You don't tear their skin off all in one go. You just shear them every year. The horde looked blank. Hunter gatherers said, "Mr. Savaloy, with a touch of hopelessness." Wrong metaphor. It's the marvelous singing sword of Wong, isn't it? Whispered six beneficent winds. That's what you're going to steal. No, in fact, steal is rather the wrong word. Well, anyway, gentlemen, you might not yet be civilized, but at least you're nice and clean, and many people think this is identical. Time, I think, for action. The horde straightened up. This was back in the area they understood. To the throne room," said Genghis Khan. Six beneficent winds wasn't that fast on the uptake, but at last he put two and two together. "It's the emperor," he said, and raised his hand to his mouth in horror, tinged with evil delight. "You're going to kidnap him." Diamonds glittered when Khan grinned. There were two dead guards in the corridor leading to the private imperial apartments. Look, how come you were all taken alive? Whispered Rincewind. The guards I saw had big swords. How come you're not dead? I suppose they planned to torture us," said Butterfly. "We did injure ten of them. Huh? Pasted posters on them, did you? Sang revolutionary songs until they gave in. Listen, someone wanted you alive." The floors sang in the darkness. Every footstep produced a chorus of squeaks and groans, just like the floorboards at the university. But you didn't expect that sort of thing in a nice shiny palace like this. They're called nightingale floors," said Butterfly. "The carpenters put little metal collars around the nails so that no one can creep up unawares." Rincewind looked down at the corpses. Neither man had drawn his sword. He leaned his weight on his left foot. The floor squeaked. Then he leaned on his right foot. The floor groaned. This isn't right, then he whispered. You can't creep up on someone on a floor like this. So someone they knew killed those guards. Let's get out of here. We go on," said Butterfly firmly. 
It's a trap. Someone's using you to do their dirty work. She shrugged. Turn left by the big jade statue. It was four in the morning, an hour before dawn. There were guards in the official staterooms, but not very many. After all, this was well inside the Forbidden City with its high walls and small gates. It wasn't as though anything was going to happen. It needed a special type of mind to stand guard over some empty rooms all night. One big river had such a mind, orbiting gently within the otherwise blissful emptiness of his skull. They'd happily called him One Big River because he was the same size and moved at the same speed as the Hung. Everyone had expected him to become a Simo wrestler, but he'd failed the intelligence test because he hadn't eaten the table. It was impossible for him to get bored. He just didn't have the imagination. But since the visor of his huge helmet registered a permanent expression of metal rage, he'd in any case cultivated the art of going to sleep on his feet. He was dozing happily now, aware only of an occasional squeaking, like that of a very cautious mouse. The helmet's visor swung up. A voice said, Would you rather die than betray your emperor? A second voice said, This is not a trick question. One big river blinked, and then turned his gaze downwards. An apparition in a squeaky-wheeled wheelchair had a very large sword pointing at exactly that inconvenient place where his upper armour didn't quite meet his lower armour. A third voice said, I should add that the last twenty-nine uh, people who answered wrong are um, dried shredded fish. Uh, sorry, uh, dead. A fourth voice said, and we're not eunuchs. One big river rumbled with the effort of thought. I think I rather live, he said. A man with diamonds where his teeth should have been gave him a comradely pat on the shoulder. Good man, he said. Join the horde. We could use a man like you, maybe as a siege weapon. Who you, he said. This is Genghis Cohen, said Mr. Savaloy, doer of mighty deeds, slayer of dragons, ravager of cities. He once bought an apple. No one laughed. Mr. Savaloy had found that the Horde had no concept whatsoever of sarcasm. Probably no one had ever tried it on them. One big river had been raised to do what he was told. Everyone had told him what to do all through his life. He fell in behind the man with diamond teeth because he was the sort of man you followed when he said follow. But, you know, there are tens of thousands of men who would die rather than betray their emperor, whispered six beneficent winds as they filed through the corridors. Oh, I hope so. Some of them will be on guard around the Forbidden City. We've avoided them, but they're still here. We have to deal with them eventually. How oh, good, said Cohen. Bad, said Mr. Savaloy. That business with the ninjas was just high spirits. High spirits? murmured six beneficent winds. But you don't want a big fight out in the open. It'll get messy. Cohen walked over to the nearest wall, which had a gorgeous pattern of peacocks, and took out his knife. Paper, he said. Bloody paper. Paper walls. He poked his head through. There was a shrill whimper. Oh, sorry, ma'am. Official wall inspection. He extracted his head, grinning. But you can't go through walls said six beneficent winds. Why not? Well, they're, they're, they're the walls. What would happen if everyone walked through the walls? What do you think doors are for? I think they're for other people, said Cohen. Which way's that throne room? What? said Mad Hamish. This is lateral thinking, explained Mr. Savaloy as they followed him. Genghis is quite good at a certain kind of lateral thinking. What a lateral? Um, it's a kind of muscle, I believe. Thinking with your muscles? Yes, I see, said Six Beneficent Winds. Rincewind sidled into a space between the wall and a statue of a rather jolly dog with its tongue hanging out. What now? said Butterfly. How big's the Red Army? We number many thousands, said Butterfly defiantly. In Hung Hung? Oh no, there is a cadre in every city. 
You know that, do you? You've met them. That would be dangerous. Only two fire herb knows how to contact them. Fancy that. Well, do you know what I think? I think someone wants a revolution, and you're all so damn respectful and polite. He's having his work cut out trying to organise one. But once you've got rebels, you can do anything. That can't be true. The、uh, rebels in other cities—they do great revolutionary deeds, do they? We hear reports all the time. From our friend Herb, Butterfly frowned. Yes. You're thinking, aren't you? Said Rincewind. The old brain cells are finally banging together. Yes. Good. Have I convinced you? I don't know. Now let's go back. No. Now I've got to find out if what you're suggesting is true. Dying to find out, eh? Good grief! You people make me so angry. Look, watch this. Rincewind strode to the end of the corridor. There was a pair of wide doors flanked by a pair of jade dragons. He flung them back. The room inside was low ceilinged but large. In the centre, under a canopy, was a bed. It was hard to make out the figure lying there, but it had that certain stillness that suggests the kind of sleep from which there is unlikely to be any kind of awakening. You see, he said, he's been killed already. A dozen soldiers were staring at Rincewind in amazement. Behind him, he heard the creaking of the floor, and then some whooshing sounds followed by a noise like wet leather being hit against a rock. Rincewind looked at the nearest soldier. The man was holding a sword. One drop of blood coursed down the blade, and with a brief pause for dramatic effect, fell on the floor. Rincewind looked up and raised his hat. "I do beg your pardon," he said brightly. "Isn't this room three B?" And ran for it. The floor screamed under him, and behind him, someone screamed Rincewind's nickname, which was "Don't let him get away." "Let me get away," Rincewind prayed. "Oh, please, let me get away." He slipped as he turned the corner, skidded through a paper wall, and landed in an ornamental fish pond. But Rincewind, in full flight, had cat-like, even messianic abilities. The water barely rippled under his feet as he bounced off the surface and headed away. Another wall erupted, and he was in what was possibly the same corridor. Behind him, someone landed heavily on a valuable koi. Rincewind shot forward again. From that was the most important factor in any mindless escape. You were always running from. Two could look after itself. He cleared a long flight of shallow stone steps, rolled upright at the bottom, and set off at random along another corridor. His legs had sorted themselves out now. First, the mad, wild dash to get you out of immediate danger, and then the good, solid strides to put as much distance as possible between you and it. That was the trick. History told of a runner who'd run forty miles after a battle to report its successful outcome to those at home. He was traditionally regarded as the greatest runner of all time. But if he'd been reporting news of an impending battle, he'd have been overtaken by Rincewind, and yet someone was gaining. A knife poked through the wall of the throne room and cut a hole large enough to afford space for an upright man or one wheelchair. There was muttering from the horde. Bruce the Hoon never went in the back way. Shut up. Never one for back gates, Bruce the Hoon. Shut up. When Bruce the Hoon attacked Al Carly, he did it right at the main guard tower with a thousand screaming men on very small horses. Yeah, but last I saw of Bruce the Hoon, his head was on a spike. All right, I'll grant you that. But at least it was over the main gate. I mean, at least he got in. His head did. Oh my! Mister Savaloy was gratified. The room they'd stepped into was enough to silence the horde, if only briefly. It was large, of course, but that hadn't been its only purpose. One sun mirror, as he welded the tribes and countries and little island nations together, had wanted a room built which said to chieftains and ambassadors, "This is the biggest space you've ever been in. It is more splendid than anything you could ever imagine, and we've got a lot more rooms like this." He had wanted it to be impressive. He had very clearly wanted it to intimidate mere barbarians so much that they'd give in there and then. Let there be huge statues, he'd said. 
and vast decorative hangings. Let there be pillars and carvings. Let the visitor be silenced by the sheer magnificence. Let it say to him, this is civilization, and you can join it or die. Now drop to your knees, or be shortened some other way. The horde gave it the benefit of their inspection. Finally, Truckle said, It's all right, I suppose, but not a patch on our chieftain's longhouse back in Scund. It hasn't even got a fire in the middle of the floor, look. It's gaudy to my mind. What? Typically foreign. I'll do away with most of these and get some decent straw on the floor, few shields round the walls. What? Mind you, get in a few hundred tables and you could have a hell of a carouse in here. Cohen walked across the huge expanse towards the throne, which was under a vast ornamental canopy. It's got an umbrella over it. Look. Probably the roof leaks. You can't trust tiles. A good reed thatch will give you forty years bone dry. The throne was lacquered wood, but with many precious gems set in it. Cohen sat down. Is this it? he said. We've done it, Teach. Yes, um, of course, now you have to get away with it, said Mr. Savaloy. I'm sorry, said Six Beneficent Winds. What have you done? You know that thing we were here to steal, said the teacher. Yes, it's the Empire. The taxman's expression didn't change for a few seconds. And then it flowed into a horrified grin. I think some breakfast is called for before we go any further, said Mr. Savaloy. Mr. Winds, perhaps you would be so good as to summon someone? The tax man was still grinning fixedly. But, uh, but you can't conquer an empire like this, he managed. You've got to have an army, like the warlords. Just walking in like this, it's against the rules, and, and there are thousands of guards. Yes, but they are all out there, said Mr. Savaloy. Guarding us, said Cohen. But they're guarding the real emperor. That's me, said Cohen. Oh, yeah, said Truckle. Who died and made you emperor? No one has to die, said Mr. Savaloy. It's called usurping. That's right, said Cohen. You just say, see ya, Gunga Ding, you're out on your ear, OK? Piss off to some island somewhere, or... Genghis, Mr. Savaloy said gently. Do you think you could refrain from referring to foreigners in that rather offensive fashion? It's not civilised. Cohen shrugged. You're still going to have big... Trouble with the guards and things, said Six Beneficent Winds. Maybe not, said Cohen. Tell them, Teach. Have you ever seen the, um, former emperor, said Mr. Savaloy? Mr. Winds? Of course not. Hardly anyone has seen... He stopped. There you are, then, said Mr. Savaloy. Very quick on the uptake, Mr. Winds, as befits the Lord High Chief Tax Gatherer. But it won't work because... Six Beneficent Winds stopped again. Mr. Savaloy's words reached his brain. Lord High Chief? Me? The black hat with the ruby red button? Yes. And a feather in it, if you like, said Cohen, munificently. The taxman looked in rapt consideration. So, if there was, say, a mere district administrator who was incredibly cruel to his staff, particularly to a hard-working deputy and thoroughly deserving of a good, sound, thrashing... As the Lord High Chief Tax Gatherer, of course, that would be entirely your affair. Six beneficent winds grin now threatened to remove the top of his head. On the subject of new taxation, he said, I've often had this thought that fresh air is all too readily available at far below the cost of production. 
We will listen to your ideas with extreme interest, said Mr. Savaloy. In the meantime, please arrange breakfast. And have summoned, said Cohen, all those buggers who think they know what the Emperor looks like. The pursuer was closing. Rincewind skidded around a corner, and there, blocking the passageway, were three guards. These were not dead. They were alive, and they had got swords. Someone cannoned into the back of him, pushing him to the ground, and leapt past. He shut his eyes. There were a couple of thumps, a groan, and then a very strange metallic noise. It was a helmet spinning round and round on the floor. He was pulled to his feet. Are you going to lie around all day? said Butterfly. Come on, they're not far behind. Rincewind glanced at the recumbent guards and then loped after the girl. How many of them are there? he managed. Seven now, but two of them are limping and one's having trouble breathing. Come on. You hit them? Do you always waste breath like this? Never found anyone who could keep up with me before. They turned a corner and almost ran into another guard. Butterfly didn't even stop. She took a ladylike step, whirled around on one foot, and kicked the man so hard on his ear that he spun around on his own axis and landed on his head. She paused, panted, and tucked her hair back into place. We should split up, she said. Oh, no, said Rincewind. I mean, I must protect you. I'll head back to the others. You lead the guards away somewhere. Can you all do that? Of course, said Butterfly testily. I told you we fought the guards. Now, if we split up, one of us is bound to escape. The murderers. We were supposed to take the blame for that. Didn't I try and tell you? I thought you wanted him dead. Yes, but we're rebels. They were palace guards. Um, no time. See you in heaven. She darted away. Oh, Rincewind looked around. It had all gone quiet. Guards appeared at the end of the corridor, but cautiously, as befitted people who just met Butterfly. There, is it her? No, it's him. Get him. He accelerated again, rounded a corner, and found that he was in a cul-de-sac that would undoubtedly, given the sounds behind, become a dead end. But there was a pair of doors. He kicked them open, ran inside, and slowed. The space inside was dark, but the sound and air suggested a large space and a certain. Flatulent component indicated some kind of stable. There was some light, though, from a fire. Rincewind trotted towards it and saw that it was under a huge cauldron, man-sized, full of boiling rice. And now that his eyes were accustomed to the gloom, he realized that there were shapes lying on slabs along both walls of an enormous room. They were snoring gently. They were, in fact, people. They might even have been humans. Or at least had humans in their ancestry before someone hundreds of years ago had said, "Let's see how big and fat we can breed people. Let's try for really big bastards." Each giant frame was dressed in what looked like a nappy to Rincewind's eyes, and was dozing happily alongside a bowl holding enough rice to explode twenty people, just in case it woke up in the night and felt like a light snack. A couple of his pursuers appeared in the doorway and stopped. Then they advanced, but very cautiously, carefully watching the gently moving mounds. "Oi, oi, oi!" shouted Rincewind. The men stopped and stared at him. "Wakey, wakey! Let's see the rising suns." He grabbed a mighty ladle and banged it on the rice cauldron. "Up you get! Hands off!、Uh, whatever you can find, and on with socks." The sleepers stirred. <laughs> The room shook as forty tree trunk legs swung off the slabs. Flesh rearranged itself so that in the gloom, Rincewind appeared to be being watched by twenty small pyramids. <sighs> those men," said Rincewind, pointing desperately at his pursuers, who were slowly backing away. "Those men have a pork sandwich, who, with mustard, who." Twenty very small heads turned. A total of eighty specialized neurons fired into life, and the floor shook. The wrestlers started to move, hopefully towards the men, in a slow but deliberate run, designed to be halted only by collision with another wrestler or a continent. <coughs> Rincewind dashed for the far door and burst through it. A couple of men were sitting in a small room, drinking tea and playing shibo, watched by a third. The wrestlers are restless. 
he shouted. I think you've got a stampede going on. A man threw down his Shibo tiles. Blast! And it's been at least an hour since they were fed. The men grabbed various nets and prods and items of protective clothing, leaving Rincewind alone. There was another door. He sashayed through it. He'd never essayed a sachet before, but he reckoned he was due a sachet for quick thinking. There was another passage. He ran down it, on the basis that absence of pursuit is no reason to stop running. Lord Hong was folding paper. He was an expert at it because when he did it, he gave it his full attention. Lord Hong had a mind like a knife, although possibly a knife with a curved blade. The door slid aside. A guard, red in the face from running, threw himself on the floor. Oh, Lord Hong, who is exalted. Yes, indeed, said Lord Hong distantly, essaying a taxing crease. What has gone wrong this time? My lord? I asked you what has gone wrong. Uh, we killed the emperor as directed. By whom? My, my lord, you commanded it. Did I? said Lord Hong, folding the paper lengthwise. The guard shut his eyes. He had a vision, a very short vision, of the future. There was a spike in it. He carried on. But the prisoners can't be found anywhere, lord. We heard someone approach and then, well, we saw two people, lord. We're chasing them, but the others have vanished. No slogans, no revolutionary posters, no culprits, no, Lord. I see. Remain here. Lord Hong's hands continued with the folding as he looked at the room's other occupant. You have something to say to Fire Herb? he said pleasantly. The revolutionary leader looked sheepish. The Red Army has been quite expensive, said Lord Hong. The printing costs alone. And you cannot say I have not helped you. We unlocked the doors and killed the guards and gave your wretched people swords and a map, did we not? And now I can hardly claim that they killed the Emperor, may he stay dead for ten thousand years, when there is no sign of them. People will ask too many questions. I can hardly kill everyone, and we appear to have some barbarians in the building too. Something must have gone wrong, my lord. Herb was hypnotized by the moving hands as they caressed that paper. What a pity. I do not like it when things go wrong. God... Redeem your miserable self. Take him away. I will have to try a different plan. My lord? Yes, to fire herb. When you... When we agreed... When it was agreed that the Red Army should be turned over to you, you did promise me indemnity. Lord Hong smiled. Oh, yes, I recall. I said, did I not, that I would neither say nor write any order for your death. And I must keep my word, otherwise what am I? He folded the last crease and opened his hands, putting the little paper decoration on the lacquered table beside him. Herb and the guard stared at it. Guard, take him away, said Lord Hong. It was a marvellously constructed paper figure of a man, but there didn't seem to have been enough paper for a head. The immediate court turned out to be about eighty men, women, and eunuchs in various states of sleeplessness. They were astonished at what sat on the throne. The horde were quite astonished at the court. Who were all of them vinegar-faced old baggages at the front? whispered Cohen, who was idly tossing a throwing knife into the air and catching it again. I wouldn't even set fire to them. They're the wives of the former emperors, hissed six beneficent winds. We don't have to marry them, do we? I don't think so. Why are their feet so small, said Cohen. 
I like to say big feet on a woman. Six beneficent winds told him. Cohen's expression hardened. I'm learning a lot about civilization, I am, he said. Long fingernails, crippled feet, and servants running around without their family jewels. Huh. What is going on here, pray? said a middle-aged man. Who are you? Who are these old eunuchs? Who are you? said Cohen. He drew his sword. I need to know so as it can be put on your gravestone. I wonder if I might effect some introductions at this point, said Mr. Savaloy. He stepped forward. This, he said, is Genghis Cohen, put it away, Genghis, who is technically a barbarian, and this is his horde. They have overrun your city, and you are barbarian invaders, said the man haughtily, ignoring him. Barbarian invaders come in their thousands, big screaming men on little horses. I told you, said Truckle, but would anyone listen? And there is fire, terror, rapine, looting, and blood in the streets. We haven't had breakfast yet, said Cohen, tossing his knife into the air again. <laughs> I would rather die than submit to such as you. Cohen shrugged. Why didn't you say so earlier? Oops, said Six Beneficent Winds. It was a very accurate throw. Who was he anyway, said Cohen, as the body folded up. Anyone know who he was? G Genghis, said Mr. Savaloy. I've, I've kept meaning to tell you, when people say they'd rather die, they don't really mean they'd rather die. Not always. Why'd they say it, then? It's the done thing. Ah, is this civilization again? Mm, I'm afraid so. Let's settle this once and for all, then, shall we? Said Cohen. He stood up. Hands up, those who'd rather die than have me as emperor. Anyone? Said Mr. Savaloy. Rincewind trotted along another passage. Was there no outside to this place? Several times he thought he'd found an exit, but it led only to a courtyard within the huge building, filled with tinkling fountains and willow trees. And the place was waking up. There were running steps behind him. A voice shouted, Hey! He dived for the nearest door. The room beyond was full of steam. It roiled in great billowing clouds. He could dimly make out a figure toiling at the huge wheel, and the words, Torture Chamber, crossed his mind, until the smell of soap replaced them with the word, Laundry. Rather wan, but incredibly clean figures looked up from their vats and watched him with barely a hint of interest. They did not look like people in close touch with current events. He half ran, half sauntered between the bubbling cauldrons. Keep it up, uh, good man, that's it. Scrub, scrub, scrub. Uh, let me see those ringers ringing. Well done. Is there um, another door out of here? Good bubbles there, very good bubbles. Ah. One of the laundry workers, who appeared to be in charge, gave him a suspicious glare and seemed to be about to say something. Rincewind dodged through a courtyard crisscrossed with washing lines and stopped, panting with his back to a wall. Although it was against his general principles, it was perhaps time to stop and think. People were chasing him. That is to say, they were chasing a running figure in a faded red robe and a very charred pointy hat. It took a great effort for Rincewind to come to terms with the idea but it was just possible that if he was wearing something else, he might not be chased. On the line in front of him, shirts and trousers flapped in the breeze. Their construction was to tailoring in the same way that wood chopping is to carpentry. Someone had mastered the art of the tube and left it at that. They looked just like the clothes nearly everyone wore in Hung Hung. The palace was almost a city in its own right, said the voice of reason. It must be full of people on all sorts of errands, it added. It would mean taking off our hat, it added. Rincewind hesitated. It would be hard for a non-wizard to grasp the enormity of the suggestion. A wizard would sooner go without his robe and trousers than forego his hat. Without his hat, people might think he was an ordinary person. There was shouting in the distance. The voice of reason could see that if it wasn't careful, it was going to end up as dead as the rest of Rincewind, and added sarcastically, All right. Keep the wretched hat. Our damned hat is why we're in this mess in the first place. Perhaps you think you're going to have a head left to wear it on. 
Rincewind's hands also were aware that times were going to be extremely interesting and very short unless they took matters into themselves, reached out slowly and removed a pair of pants and a shirt and rammed them inside his robe. The door burst open. There were still guards behind him, and a couple of the Tsimo herders had joined in the chase. One of them waved a prod in Rincewind's direction. He plunged towards an archway and out into the garden. It had a little pagoda. It had willow trees and a pretty lady on a bridge feeding the birds. And a man painting a plate. Cohen rubbed his hands together. No one? Good. That's all sorted, then. <clears throat> A small man at the front of the crowd made a great play of keeping his hands to himself, but said, Um, excuse me, but, um, what would happen in the hypothetical situation of us calling the guards and denouncing you? We'd kill you all before they were halfway through the door, said Cohen, matter-of-factly. Any more questions? he added, to a chorus of gasps. Uh, the Emperor, uh, th that is to say, the last emperor, had some very special guards. There was a tinkling sound. Something small and multi-pointed rolled down the steps and spun round on the floor. It was a throwing star. Met them, said Boy Willie. Fine, fine, said the little man. Eh, that all seems in order. Mm, ten thousand years to the emperor. The shout was taken up. A little raggedly. What's your name, young man? said Mr. Savaloy. Four bighorns, my lord. Very good, very good. I can see that you will go a long way. What is your job? I am grand assistant to the Lord Chamberlain, my lord. Which one of you is the Lord Chamberlain? Four bighorns pointed to the man who had preferred to die. There we are, you see, said Mr. Savaloy. Promotion comes fast to adaptable people, Lord Chamberlain. And now the Emperor will breakfast. And what is his pleasure? said the new Lord Chamberlain, endeavouring to look bright and adaptable. All sorts of things, but uh, right now... Big lumps of meat and lots of beer. You will find the Emperor very easy to cater for. Mr. Savaloy smiled the knowing little smile he sometimes smiled when he knew he was the only one seeing the joke. The Emperor doesn't favour what he calls a uh, fiddly foreign muck full of eyeballs and such like, and much prefers simple wholesome food like sausages which are made of miscellaneous animal organs, minced up in a length of intestine. <laughs> but if you want to please him, just keep up the big lumps of meat. Isn't that so, my lord? Cohen had been gazing at the assembled courtiers. When you've survived for ninety years all the attacks that can be thrown at you by men, women, trolls, dwarfs, giants, green things with lots of legs, and on one occasion an enraged lobster, you can learn a lot by looking at faces. Eh? said Cohen. Oh, yep, right, right enough. Big lumps. Here, Mr. Taxman, what do these people do all day? What would you like them to do? I'd like them to buck her off. Sorry, my lord? Uh, complicated pictogram, said Mr. Savaloy. The new Lord Chamberlain looked a little startled. What? Here? It's a figure of speech, lad. He just means he wants everyone to go away quickly. The court scurried out. A sufficiently complicated pictogram is worth a thousand words. After the stampede, the artist Three Solid Frogs got to his feet, retrieved his brush from his nostril, pulled his easel out of a tree, and tried to think placid thoughts. The garden was not what it had been. The willow tree was bent. The pagoda had been demolished by an out-of-control wrestler who had eaten the roof. The doves had flown. The little bridge had been broken. His model, the concubine Jade Fan, had run off crying after she'd managed to scramble out of the ornamental pond. And someone had stolen his straw hat. Three solid frogs adjusted what remained of his dress and endeavoured to compose himself. The plate with his sketch on had been smashed, of course. 
He pulled another one out of his bag and reached for his pallet. There was a huge footprint in the middle of it. He wanted to cry. He'd had such a good feeling about this picture. He just knew it would be one that people would remember for a long time. And the colours. Did anyone understand how much vermilion cost these days? He pulled himself together. So there was only blue left. Well, he'd show them. He tried to ignore the devastation in front of him and concentrated on the picture in his mind. Let me see now, he thought. Jade Fan being pursued over a bridge by a man waving his arms and screaming, Get out of the way, followed by a man with prod, three guards, five laundry men, and a wrestler unable to stop. He had to simplify it a bit, of course. The pursuers rounded a corner, except for the wrestler who wasn't built for such a difficult maneuver. Where did he go? They were in the courtyard. There were pigsties on one side and middens on the other. And in the middle of the courtyard, a pointy hat. One of the guards reached out and grabbed a colleague's arm before the man stepped forward. Steady now, he said. It's just a hat. So where's the rest of him? He couldn't have just disappeared into... They backed away. You heard about him too? They said he blew a hole in the wall just by waving his hands. That's nothing. I heard he appeared on an invisible dragon up in the mountains. What shall we tell Lord Hong? I don't want to be blown to pieces. I don't want to tell Lord Hong we lost him. We're in enough trouble already, and I've only just paid for this helmet. Well, we could take the hat. That'd be evidence. Right. You pick it up. Me? You pick it up. It might be surrounded by terrible spells. Oh, really? So it's all right for me to touch it? Thank you. Get one of them to pick it up. The laundry men backed away. The hung hung ease habit of obedience evaporating like morning dew. The soldiers weren't the only ones to have heard rumours. Not us. Got a rush order for socks. The guard turned. A peasant was stumbling out of one of the pigsties, carrying a sack, his face covered in a big straw hat. Hey, you! The man dropped to his knees and banged his head on the ground. Don't kill me. The guards exchanged a glance. We ain't gonna kill you, said one of them. We just want you to try and pick up that hat over there. What hat, oh mighty warrior? That hat there, right now. The man crawled crabwise across the cobbles. This hat, oh great lord? Yes. The man's fingers crept over the stones and prodded the hat's ragged brim. Then he screamed. Your wife is a big hippo. My face is melting. My face is melting. Rincewind waited until the sounds of fleeing sandals had quite faded. Then he stood up, dusted off his hat, and put it in the sack. That had gone a lot better than he'd expected. So there was another valuable thing to know about the Empire. No one looked at peasants. It must be the clothes and the hat. No one but the common people dressed like that, so anyone dressed like that must be a common person. It was the advertising principle of a wizard's hat, but in reverse. You were careful and polite around people in a pointy hat in case they took a very physical offence. Whereas someone in a big straw hat was a suitable target for, hey, you, and a... It was at exactly this point that someone behind him shouted, hey, you, and hit Rincewind across the shoulders with a stick. The irate face of a servant appeared in front of him. The man waved a finger in front of Rincewind's nose. You are late. You are a bad man. Get inside right now. Uh, the stick hit Rincewind again. The servant pointed at a distant doorway. Insolence. Shame. Go to work. Rincewind's brain prepared the words, Oh, so we think we're clever sand just because we've got a big stick, do we? Well, I happen to be a great wizard, and you know what you can do with your big stick. Somewhere between the brain and his mouth, they became, Yes, sir, right away. The horde were left alone. Well, gentlemen, we did it, said Mr. Savaloy eventually. You have the world on a plate. All the treasure we want, said Truckle. That's right. Let's not hang around then, said Truckle. Let's get some sacks. There's no point, said Mr. Savaloy. You'd only be stealing from yourselves. This is an empire. You don't just shove it in a bag and divvy it up at the next campfire. 
How about the ravishing? Mr. Savaloy sighed. There are, I understand, three hundred concubines in the Imperial Harem. I'm sure they will be very pleased to see you, although matters will be improved if you take your boots off. The old men wore the puzzled look such as might be worn by fish trying to understand the concept of the bicycle. We ought to take just small stuff, said Boy Willie at last. Rubies and emeralds for preference. And chuck a match on the place as we go out, said Vincent. These paper walls and all this lacquered wood should go up a treat. No, 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 said Mr. Savaloy. The vases in this room alone are priceless. Nah, too big to carry. Can't get them on a horse. But I've shown you civilization, said Mr. Savaloy. Yeah, it's all right to visit. Ain't that so, Cohen? Cohen was hunched down in the throne, glaring at the far wall. What's that? I'm saying we take everything we can carry and head off back home, right? Home? Yeah, uh, yeah. That was the plan, yeah? Cohen didn't look at Mr. Savaloy's face. Yeah, the plan, he said. It's a good plan," said Truckle. "It's a great idea. You move in as boss. Fine. Great scam. Saves trouble. None of that fiddling with locks and things. So we'll all be off home, okay? With all the treasure we can carry." "What for?" said Cohen. "What for? It's treasure." Cohen seemed to reach a decision. "What did you spend your last haul on, Truckle?" You said you got three sacks of gold and gems from that haunted castle. Truckle looked puzzled, as if Cohen had asked what purple smelled like. Spend it on? I don't know. You know how it is. What's it matter what you spend it on? It's loot. Anyway, what do you spend yours on? Cohen sighed. Truckle gaped at him. You're not thinking of really staying here. He glared at Mr. Savaloy. Have you two been cooking up something? Cohen drummed his fingers on the arm of the throne. You said go home. He said, "Where to?" Well, wherever. And Hamish there? What? What? I mean, he's a hundred and five, right? Time to settle down, maybe. What? Settle. Down," said Truckle. "You tried it once. Stole a farm and said you was going to raise pigs. Gave it up after what was it? Three hours. What's he saying? What's he saying? He said it's time you settled down, Hamish. Bugger that! The kitchens were in uproar. Half the court had ended up there. In most cases, for the first time. The place was as crowded as a street market, through which the servants tried to go about their business as best they could. The fact that one of them seemed a little unclear as to what his business actually consisted of was quite unnoticed in the turmoil. Did you smell him? said Lady Two Streams. The stink. Like a hot day in a pig yard, said Lady Peach Petal. I'm pleased to say I have never experienced that, said Lady Two Streams haughtily. Lady Jade Knight, who was rather younger than the other two, and who had been rather attracted to Cohen's smell of unwashed lion, said nothing. The head cook said, "Just that, big lumps. Why doesn't he just eat a cow while he's about it?" "You wait till you hear about this devil food called sausage," said the Lord Chamberlain. "Big lumps." The cook was almost in tears. "Where's the skill in big lumps of meat? Not even sauce." I'd rather die than simply eat up big lumps of meat. Ah," said the new Lord Chamberlain. "I should think very carefully about that. The new Emperor, may he have a bath for ten thousand years, tends to interpret that as a request." The babble of voices stopped. The cause of the sudden silence was one small sharp noise. It was a cork popping. Lord Hong had a Grand Vizier's talent for apparently turning up out of nowhere. His gaze. Swept the kitchens. 
It was certainly the only housework he had ever done. He stepped forward. He'd taken a small black bottle from out of the sleeve of his robe. Bring me the meat, he said. The sauce will take care of itself. The assembled people watched with horrified interest. Poison was all part of the Hung Hungese court etiquette, but people generally did it while hidden from sight somewhere, out of good manners. Is there anyone, said Lord Hong, who has anything they would like to say? His gaze was like a scythe. As it swung around the room, people wavered and hesitated and fell. Very well, said Lord Hong. I would rather die than see a barbarian on the imperial throne. Let him have his big lumps. Bring me the meat. There was a movement in the ground and the sound of shouting and the thump of a stick. A peasant scuttled forward, reluctantly wheeling a huge covered dish on a trolley. At the sight of Lord Hong, he pushed the trolley aside, flung himself forward and groveled. I avert my gaze from your orchard in a favourable position. Damn, uh, countenance, O oh Lord. Lord Hong prodded the prone figure with his foot. It is good to see the arts of respect maintained, he observed. Remove the lid. The man got up, and still bowing and ducking, lifted the cover. Lord Hong upended the bottle and held it there until the last drop had hissed out. His audience was transfixed. And now let it be taken to the barbarians, he said. Certainly, your celestial ink brush, uh, uh, willow frond, um, uh, righteousness. Where are you from, peasant? Best Pelagic, O、oh、Lord. Ah, I thought so. The big bamboo doors slid back. The new Lord Chamberlain stepped in, followed by a caravan of trolleys. Breakfast, O、oh、Lord, of a thousand years. He said, "Big lumps of pig, big lumps of goat, big lumps of ox, and seven fried rice." One of the servants lifted the lid of a dish. "But take my tip and don't go for this pork," he said. "It's been poisoned." The chamberlain spun around. "Insolent pig! You will die for this." "It's ringswind, isn't it?" said Cohen. Looks like Rincewind. Got my hat here somewhere," said Rincewind. "Had to stuff it down my trousers." "Poison," said Cohen. "You sure?" "Well, okay. It was a black bottle, and it had a skull and crossbones on it. And when he tipped it out, it smoked," said Rincewind, as Mister Savaloy helped him up. "Was it anchovy essence? I don't think so." "Poison," said Cohen. "I hate poisoners. Just about the worst sort, poisoners." Creeping around, putting muck in a man's grub. He glared at the Chamberlain. Was it you? He looked at Rincewind and jerked a thumb towards the cowering Chamberlain. Was it him? Because if it was, he's going to get done to him what I did to the mad snake priests of Start. And this time I'll use both thumbs. No, said Rincewind. It was someone they called Lord Hong, but they all watched him do it. A little scream erupted from the Lord Chamberlain. He threw himself to the floor and was about to kiss Cohen's foot until he realised that this would have about the same effect as eating the pork. Mercy, O、oh、celestial being! We are all pawns in the hands of Lord Hong. What's so special about Lord Hong then? He's、uh, a fine man. The Chamberlain gibbered. I won't say a word against Lord Hong. I certainly don't believe it's true that he has spies everywhere. Long life to Lord Hong. That's what I say. He risked looking up and found the point of Cohen's sword just in front of his eyes. Yeah, but right now, who are you more frightened of, me or this Lord Hong? Um, Lord Hong. Cohen raised an eyebrow. Oh, I'm impressed. Spies everywhere, eh? He looked around the huge room, and his gaze came to rest on a very large vase. He sauntered over to it and raised the lid. You okay in there? Uh, yes," said a voice from the depths of the vase. "Got everything you want? Spare notebook, potty. Um, yes. Would you like 
Oh, let's say about 60 gallons of boiling water. Um, no. Would you rather die than betray Lord Hong? Um, can I have a moment to think about it, please? No problem. It takes a long time to heat the water in any case. As you were, then. He replaced the lid. One big mother, he said. Um, that's, um, that's one big river, Genghis, said Mr. Savaloy. The guard rumbled into life. Just you watch this vase, and if it moves again, you do to it what I once did to the green necromancer of the night. All right. Don't know what it was you did, Lord, said the soldier. Cohen told him. One big river beamed. From inside the jar came the noise of someone trying not to be sick. Cohen strolled back to the throne. So, tell me a bit more about Lord Hong, then, he said. He's the Grand Vizier, said the Chamberlain. Cohen and Rincewind looked at one another. That's right, and everyone knows, said Rincewind, that Grand Viziers are always... Complete and utter bastards, said Cohen. Don't know why. Give them a turban with a point in the middle, and their moral was name just gets eaten away. I always kill him as soon as I meet him. Save time later on. I thought there was something fishy about him as soon as I saw him, said Rincewind. Look, Cohen... That's Emperor Cohen to you, said Truckle. I've never trusted wizards, mister. Never trusted any man in a dress. Rincewind's all right, said Cohen. Thank you, said Rincewind. But a bloody useless wizard. I just happened to risk my neck to save you. Thank you so very much, said Rincewind. Look, some friends of mine are in the prison block. Could you... Emperor? Well, sort of, said Cohen. Temporary said Truckle. Mm, technically, said Mr. Savaloy. Does that mean you can get my friends somewhere safe? I think Lord Hong has murdered the old emperor and wants them to take the blame. I'm just hoping he won't believe they'll be hiding in the cells. Why in the cells, said Cohen. Because if I had the chance to get away from Lord Hong's cells, I would, said Rincewind fervently. No one in their right minds would go back inside if they thought they had a chance to get away. OK, said Cohen. Boy, Willie, one big mother, go and round up some of your mates and bring those people here. Here, said Rincewind. I wanted them to be somewhere safe. Well, we're here, said Cohen. We can protect them. Who's going to protect you? Cohen ignored this. Lord Chamberlain, he said. I don't expect Lord Hong will be around, but uh, in the court was a guy with a nose like a badger. A fat bugger he was, with a pink hat and a skinny woman with a face like a hat full of pins. That would be Lord Nine Mountains and Lady Two Streams, said the Lord Chamberlain. Uh, you are not angry with me, O oh Lord? God bless you, no, said Cohen. In fact, mister, I'm so impressed I'm going to give you extra responsibilities. Lord? Food taster, for a start. And now go and fetch their mother too. I don't like the look of them at all. Nine mountains and two streams were ushered in a few moments later. The merest glance from Cohen to the untouched food would have passed entirely unnoticed by those who weren't watching for it. Cohen nodded cheerfully at them. Eat it, he said. My lord, I had a large breakfast. I am entirely full, said Nine Mountains. That's a pity, said Cohen. One big mother, before you go off, just see Mr. Nine Mountains over there and make some room in him so he can have another breakfast. The same goes for the lady, too, if I don't hear chomping in the next five seconds. A good mouthful of everything, understand? With lots of sauce. One big river drew his sword. The two nobles stared fixedly at the glistening mounds. Looks good to me, said Cohen, conversationally. The way you're looking at it, anyone would think there was something wrong with it. Nine Mountains gingerly put a piece of pork into his mouth. Extremely good, he said indistinctly. Now, swallow, said Cohen. The mandarin gulped. Marvellous, he said. And now, if your excellency will excuse me, I... Don't rush off, said Cohen. We don't want you accidentally sticking your fingers down your throat or anything like that, do we? Nine Mountains hiccuped. Then he hiccuped again. Smoke appeared to be rising from the bottom of his robe. 
The horde dived for cover just as the explosion removed an area of floorboards, a circular part of the ceiling, and all of Lord Nine Mountains. A black hat with a ruby button on it spun around on the floor for a moment. That's just like me and pickled onions, said Vincent. Lady Two Streams was standing with her eyes shut. Not hungry, said Cohen. She nodded. Cohen leaned back. One big mother? It's River, Cohen, said Mr. Savaloy, as the guard lumbered forward. Take her with you and put her in one of the dungeons. See that she has plenty to eat, if you know what I mean. Yes, Excellency. And Mr. Chamberlain here can push off down to the kitchen again and tell the chef he's going to share what we eat this time, and he's going to eat it first. All right? Yes, indeed, Excellency. Call this living, Caleb burst out as the Lord Chamberlain scuttled away. This is being emperor, is it? Can't even trust the food. We'll probably be murdered in our beds. Can't see you being murdered in your bed, said Truckle. Yeah, because you're never in it, said Cohen. He walked over to the big jar and gave it a kick. You getting all this? Yes, sir, said the jar. There was some laughter, but it had an edge of nervousness. Mr. Savaloy realised that the horde weren't used to this. If a true barbarian wanted to kill someone during a meal, he'd invite him in with all his henchmen, sit them down, get them drunk and sleepy, and then summon his own men from hiding places to massacre them instantly in a straightforward, no-nonsense and honourable manner. It was completely fair. The get-them-drunk-and-butcher-the-lot-of-them stratagem was the oldest trick in a book, or would have been if barbarians bothered with books. Anyone falling for it would be doing the world a favour by being slaughtered over the pudding. But at least you could trust the food. Barbarians didn't poison food. You never knew when you might be short of a mouthful yourself. Excuse me, Your Excellency, said Six Beneficent Winds, who had been hovering. I think Lord Truckle is right. Ah, uh, I know a little history... The correct method of succession is to wade to the throne through seas of blood. That is what Lord Hong is planning to do. You say? Seas of blood, right? Or over a mountain of skulls. That's an option, too. But, um, but I, I thought the imperial crown was handed down from father to son, said Mr. Savaloy. Well, yes, said Six Beneficent Winds. I suppose that could happen, in theory. You said once we were at the top of the pyramid, everyone would do what we said, said Cohen to Mr. Savaloy. Truckle looked from one to the other. You two planned this, he said accusingly. This is what it's all been about, isn't it? All that learning to be civilised, and right at the start you just said it was going to be a really big theft. Eh? Hey? I thought we were just going to nick a load of stuff and push off. Loot and pillage, that's the way. Oh, loot and pillage, loot and pillage. I've had it up to here with loot and pillage, said Mr. Savaloy. Is that all you can think of? Looting and pillaging? Well, there used to be ravishing, too, said Vincent, wistfully. I hate to tell you, but they've got a point, Teach, said Cohen. Fighting and looting, that's what we do. I ain't happy with all this bowing and scraping business. I ain't sure if I was cut out for civilization. Mr. Savaloy rolled his eyes. Even you, Cohen, you're all so dim-witted, he snapped. I don't know why I bother. I mean, look at you. You know what you are. You're legends. The horde stepped back. No one had ever seen Teach lose his temper before. From legendum, which means something written down, said Mr. Savaloy. Books, you know, reading and writing, which incidentally is as alien to you as the lost city of E. Truckle's hand went up a little nervously. Actually... I once discovered the lost city of E. Shut up! I'm saying... Ugh, what was I saying? Yes, you don't read, do you? You never learned to read. 
then you've wasted half your life. You could have been accumulating pearls of wisdom instead of rather shoddy gems. It's just as well people read about you and don't meet you face to face because, gentlemen, you are a big disappointment. Rincewind watched, fascinated, waiting for Mr. Savaloy to have his head cut off. But this didn't seem about to happen. He was possibly too angry to be beheaded. What have you actually done, gentlemen? And don't tell me about stolen jewels and demon lords. What have you done that's real? Truckle raised a hand again. Well, I once killed all four of the... Yes, 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 said Mr. Savaloy. You killed this and you stole that and you defeated the giant man-eating avocados of somewhere else. But it's all... it's all... stuff. It's just wallpaper, gentlemen. It never changes anything. No one cares. Back in Ankh Morpork, I've taught boys who think you are myths. That's what you've achieved. They don't believe you ever really existed. They think someone made you up. Your stories, gentlemen. And when you die, no one will know, because they think you're already dead. He paused for breath, and then continued more slowly. But here, here you could be real. You could stop playing at your lives. You could take this ancient and somewhat rotten empire back into the world. At least, he trailed off, that's what I'd hoped. I really thought that perhaps we might actually achieve something. He sat down. The horde stood staring at its various feet, or wheels. Um, can I say something? The warlords will all be against you, said Six Beneficent Winds. They're out there now with their armies. Normally they'd fight amongst themselves, but they'll all fight you. They'd rather have some poisoner like this Hong instead of me, said Cohen. But he's a bastard. Yes, but he's their bastard, you see. We could hold out here. This place has got thick walls, said Vincent. The one's not made of paper, that is. Don't think about that, said Truckle. Not a siege. Sieges are messy. I hate eating boots and rats. What? said Mad Hamish. He said we don't want a siege where we have to eat boots and rats, Hamish. Run out of legs, have we? How many soldiers have they got? said Cohen. I think six or seven hundred thousand, said the taxman. Excuse us, said Cohen, getting off the throne. I have to join my horde. The horde went into a huddle. There was an occasional, What? in the hoarse, whispered interchange. Then Cohen turned round. Seas of blood, wasn't it? he said. Um, yes, said the taxman. The huddle resumed. After some further exchanges, Truckle's head poked up. Did you say, mountain of skulls? he said. Yes, yes, I think that's what I said, said the taxman. He glanced nervously at Rincewind and Mr. Savaloy, who shrugged. Whisper, whisper, what? Excuse me? Yes? About how big a mountain? Skulls don't pile up that well. I don't know how big a mountain. A lot of skulls. Just checking. The horde seemed to reach a decision. They turned to face the other men. We are going to fight said Cohen. Yes, you should have said all that about skulls and blood before, said Truckle. We'll show you whether we're dead or not, cackled Hamish. Mr. Savaloy shook his head. I think you must have misheard. The odds are a hundred thousand to one, he said. I reckon that'll show people we're still alive, said Caleb. 
Yes, but the whole point of my plan was to show you that you could get to the top of the pyramid without having to fight your way up, said Mr. Savaloy. It really is possible in such a stale society. But if you try to fight hundreds of thousands of men, you'll die. And then, to his surprise, he found himself adding, probably. The horde grinned at him. Big odds don't frighten us, said Truckle. We like big odds, said Caleb. You see, Teach, odds of a thousand to one ain't a lot worse than ten to one, said Cohen. The reason being, he counted on his fingers, one, your basic soldier who's fighting for pay rather than his life ain't going to stick his neck out when there's all these other blokes around who might as well do the business. And two, not very many of them are going to be able to get near us at one time and then all be pushing and shoving. And, he looked at his fingers with an expression of terminal calculation. Um, three, said Mr. Savaloy, hypnotised by his logic. Three, right, half the time, when they swing their swords, they'll hit one of their mates, saving us a bit of effort, see? But even if that were true, it'd only work for a little while, Mr. Savaloy protested. Even if you killed as many as two hundred, you'd be tired, and there'd be fresh troops attacking you. Oh, they'll be tired too, said Cohen cheerfully. Why? Because by then, to get to us, they'd have had to be running uphill. That's logic, that is, said Truckle approvingly. Cohen slapped the shaken teacher on the back. Don't you worry about a thing, he said. If we've got the empire by your kind of plan, we'll keep it by our kind of plan. You've shown us civilization, so we'll show you barbarism. He walked a few steps and then turned, an evil glint in his eye. Barbarism? Ha! When we kill people, we do it there and then, looking them in the eye, and we'd be happy to buy them a drink in the next world. No harm done. I never knew a barbarian who cut up people slowly in little rooms or tortured women to make them look pretty or put poison in people's grub. Civilization? If that's civilization, you can shove it where the sun don't shine. What? He said, shove it where the sun doesn't shine, Hamish. Ah, I've been there. But there is more to civilization than that, said Mr. Savaloy. There's music and, and literature and the concept of justice and the ideals of... The bamboo doors slid aside. As one man, joints creaking, the horde turned with weapons raised. The men in the doorway were taller and much more richly dressed than the peasants, and they moved in the manner of people who are used to there being no one in the way. Ahead of them, though, was a trembling peasant holding a red flag on a stick. He was prodded into the room at sword point. Red flag? whispered Cohen. It means they want to parley, said Six Beneficent Winds. You know, it's like our white flag of surrender, said Mr. Savaloy. Never heard of it, said Cohen. It means you mustn't kill anyone until they're ready. Mr. Savaloy tried to shut out the whispers behind him. Why don't we just invite them to dinner and massacre them all when they're drunk? You heard the man. The seven hundred thousand of them. Ah, so it did have to be something simple with pasta then. A couple of the lords strode into the middle of the room. Cohen and Mr. Savaloy went to meet them. And you too, said Cohen, grabbing Rincewind as he tried to back away. You're a weaselly man with words in a tight spot, so come on. Lord Hong regarded them with the expression of a man whose ancestry had bequeathed to him the ability to look down on everything. My name is Lord Hong. I am the Emperor's Grand Vizier. I order you to quit this premises immediately and submit to a judgment. Mr. Savaloy turned to Cohen. I ain't gonna, said Cohen. Mr. Savaloy tried to think. Um, um uh, how shall I phrase this? Um, Genghis Cohen, leader of the Silver Horde, presents his compliments to the Lord Hong, but tell him he can stuff it, said Cohen. I think, Lord Hong, that perhaps you may have perceived the general flow of opinion here, said Mr. Savaloy. 
Where are the rest of your barbarians, peasant? He demanded. Rinswind watched Mr. Savaloy. The old teacher seemed at a loss for words this time. The wizard wanted to run away, but Cohen had been right. Mad as it sounded, it was probably safer to be near him. Running away would put him closer, sooner or later, to Lord Hong, who believed that there were other barbarians somewhere. I tell you this and this only," said Lord Hong. "If you quit the Forbidden City now, your deaths, at least, will be quick, and then your heads and significant parts will be paraded through the cities of the Empire, so that people will know of the terrible punishment." Punishment," said Mr. Savaloy, "for killing the Emperor." We ain't killed no emperor," said Cohen. "I've got nothing against killing emperors, but we ain't killed one. He was killed in his bed an hour ago," said Lord Hong. "Not by us," said Mr. Savaloy. "By you," said Rincewind. "Only it's against the rules to kill the emperor, so you wanted it to look as though the Red Army did it." Lord Hong looked at him as if seeing him for the first time, and less than happy about doing so. In the circumstances," said Lord Hong, "I doubt that anyone will believe you. What will happen if we yield now?" said Mister Savaloy. "I like to know these things." Then you will die very slowly in interesting ways. That's the saga of my life," said Cohen. "I've always been dying very slowly in interesting ways. What's it to be? Street fighting, house to house?" Free for all, or what? In the real world," said one of the other lords, "we battle. We do not scuffle like barbarians. Our armies will meet on the plain before the city. Before the city, what? He means in front of the city, Cohen. Ah,、oh, civilized talk again. When? Dawn tomorrow. Okay," said Cohen. It will give us an appetite for our breakfast. Anything else we can do for you? How big is your army, barbarian? You would not believe how big," said Cohen, which was probably true. We have overrun countries. We have wiped whole cities off the map. Where my army passes, nothing grows. That's true, at least," said Mister Savaloy. We have not heard of you," said the warlord. Yeah," said Cohen. "That's how good we are." There is one other thing about his army, actually," said someone. They all turned to Rincewind, who'd been almost as surprised as they were to hear his voice. But a train of thought had just reached the terminus. Yes, you may have been wondering why you have only seen the generals. Rincewind went on slowly, as if working it out as he went along. That is because you see. The men themselves are invisible. Yes, ghosts. In fact, everyone knows this, don't they? Cohen gaped at him in astonishment. Blood-sucking ghosts, as a matter of fact," said Rincewind. "After all, everyone knows that's what you get beyond the wall, don't they?" Lord Hong sneered. But the warlords stared at Rincewind with the expressions of people who strongly suspected that the people beyond the wall were flesh and blood, but who also relied on millions of people not believing that this was so. Ridiculous! You are not invisible, blood-sucking ghosts," said one of them. Cohen opened his mouth so that the diamond teeth glinted. "He's right," he said. "Fact is, we are the visible sort." Ha! A pathetic attempt," said Lord Hong. "Ghosts or no ghosts, we will beat you." Well, that went better than I expected," Mr. Savaloy remarked as the warlord strode out. "Was that an attempt at a little bit of psychological warfare, there, Mr. Rincewind?" "Is that what it was? I know about that kind of stuff," said Cohen. It's where you bang your shield all night before the fight, so the enemy can't get any sleep, and you sing, "We're gonna cut your tonkers off" and stuff like that. Similar," said Mr. Savaloy diplomatically, "but it failed to work, I'm afraid. 
Lord Hong and his generals are rather too sophisticated. It's a great shame you couldn't try it on the common soldiers. There was a faint squeak of rabbit behind them. They turned and looked at the somewhat underage cadre of the Red Army that was being ushered in. Butterfly was with them. She even gave Rincewind a very faint smile. Rincewind had always relied on running away, but sometimes perhaps you had to stand and fight, if only because there was nowhere left to run. But he was no good at all with weapons, at least the normal sort. Um, he said, if we leave the palace now, we'll be killed, right? I doubt it, said Mr. Savaloy. It's become a matter of the art of war now. Someone like Hong would probably slit our throats. But now war is declared. Uh, things have to be done according to custom. Rincewind took a deep breath. It's a million to one chance, he said. But it might just work. The four horsemen whose ride presages the end of the world are known to be death, war, famine, and pestilence. But even less significant events have their own horsemen. For example, the four horsemen of the common cold are sniffles, chesty, nostril, and lack of tissues. The four horsemen whose appearance foreshadows any public holiday are storm, gales, sleet, and contraflow. Among the armies encamped in the broad alluvial plain around Hung Hung, the invisible horsemen known as misinformation, rumour and gossip saddled up. A large army encamped has all the tedious problems of a city without any of the advantages. Its watchfires and picket lines are, after a while, open to local civilians, especially if they have anything to sell, and even more so if they are women whose virtue has a certain commercial element, and even sometimes if they appear to be selling food which is a break from the monotonous army diet. The food currently on sale was certainly such a break. Pork balls! Pork balls! Get them while they... There was a pause as the vendor mentally tried out ways of ending the sentence and gave up. Pork balls! On a stick! How about you, Shogun? You look like... Here, aren't you the... Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up! Rincewind pulled D.M.H. Dibala into the shadows by a tent. The trader looked at the anguished face framed between a eunuch outfit and a big straw hat. It's the wizard, isn't it? How are you? You know how you seriously wanted to become very rich in international trade, Rincewind said. Yes, can we start? Soon, soon, but there's something you must do. You know this rumour about the army of invisible vampire ghosts that's heading this way? D.M.H. Dibala's eyes swivelled nervously, but it was part of his stock in trade never to appear to be ignorant of anything except, perhaps, how to give correct change. Yes, he said. The one about there being millions of them, said Rincewind, and very hungry on account of not having eaten on the way, and made specially fierce by the great wizard. Um, yes. Well, it's not true. It's not? You don't believe me? After all, I ought to know. Good point. And we don't want people to panic, do we? Very bad for business, panic, said DMH, nodding uncomfortably. So make sure you tell people there's no truth in this rumour, will you? Set their minds at rest. Good idea. Uh, these invisible vampire ghosts... Do they carry money of any sort? No, because they don't exist. Ah, yes, I forgot. And there are not two million three hundred thousand and nine of them, said Rincewind. He was rather proud of this little detail. Not two million three hundred thousand and nine of them, said DMH, a little glassy-eyed. Absolutely not. There are not two million three hundred thousand and nine of them, no matter what anyone says, nor has the great wizard made them twice as big as normal. Good man. Now, I'd better be off. Rincewind hurried away. The trader stood in thought for a while. It stole over him that he'd probably sold enough things for now, and he might as well go home and spend a quiet night in a barrel in the root cellar with a sack over his head. His route led him through quite a large part of the camp. He made sure that soldiers he met knew there was no truth in the rumour, even though this invariably meant that, first of all, he had to tell them what the rumour actually was. A toy rabbit squeaked nervously. And I'm afraid of the big invisible vampire ghosts, sobbed Favourite Pearl. 
The soldiers around this particular campfire tried to comfort her, but unfortunately there was no one to comfort them. And I heard they already ate some men. One or two soldiers looked over their shoulders. There was nothing to be seen in the darkness. This wasn't, however, a reassuring sign. The Red Army moved obliquely from campfire to campfire. Rincewind had been very specific. He'd spent all his adult life, at least those parts of it where he wasn't being chased by things with more legs than teeth, in Unseen University, and he felt he knew what he was talking about here. Don't tell people anything, he said. Don't tell them. You didn't get to survive as a wizard in UU by believing what people told you. You believed what you were not told. Don't tell them. Ask them. Ask them if it's true. You can beg them to tell you it's not true, or you can even tell them you've been told to tell them it's not true, and that is the best of all. Because Rincewind knew very well that when the four rather small and nasty horsemen of panic ride out, there is a good job done by misinformation, rumour and gossip, but they are as nothing compared to the fourth horseman, whose name is Denial. After an hour, Rincewind felt quite unnecessary. There were conversations breaking out everywhere, particularly in those areas on the edge of the camps, where the night stretched away so big and dark and so very obviously empty. All right, so how come they're saying there's not two million three hundred thousand and nine of them, eh? If there's none of them, then why is there a number? Look, there's no such thing as invisible vampire ghosts, all right? Oh, yeah? How do you know? Have you ever seen any? Listen, I went and asked the captain, and he says he's certain there's no invisible ghosts out there. How can he be certain if he can't see them? He says there's no such thing as invisible vampire ghosts at all. Oh? How come he's saying that all of a sudden? My grandfather told me there's millions of them outside the... Hold on. Hold on. What's out there? What? Could have sworn I heard something. I can't see anything. Oh, no. Things must have filtered through to the high command, because getting on towards midnight, trumpets were sounded around the camps and a special proclamation was read out. It confirmed the reality of vampire ghosts in general, but denied their existence in any specific here-and-now sense. It was a masterpiece of its type, particularly since it brought the whole subject to the ears of soldiers the Red Army hadn't been able to reach yet. An hour later, the situation had reached the point of criticality, and Rincewind was hearing things he personally hadn't made up, and, on the whole, would much rather not hear. He'd chat with a couple of soldiers and say, I'm sure there's no huge hungry army of vampire ghosts, and get told, No, there's seven old men. Just seven old men? I've heard they're very old, said a soldier. Like too old to die. I heard from someone at the palace that they can walk through walls and make themselves invisible. Oh, come on, said Rincewind. Seven old men fighting this whole army. Makes you think, eh? Corporal Toshi says the great wizard is helping them. Stands to reason. I wouldn't be fighting a whole army if I didn't have a lot of magic on my side. Um, anyone know what this great wizard looks like? said Rincewind. They say he's taller than a house and got three heads. Rincewind nodded encouragingly. I heard, said the soldier, that the Red Army is going to fight on their side too. So what? Corporal Toshi says they're just a bunch of kids. No, I heard the real Red Army, you know. The Red Army ain't going to side with the barbarian invaders. Anyway, there's no such thing as the Red Army. They're just a myth. Like the invisible vampire ghosts, said Rincewind, giving the clockwork of anxiety another little turn. Er, uh, yeah. He left them arguing. No one was deserting. Running off into a night full of non-specific terrors was worse than staying in camp. But that was all to the good, he decided. It meant that the really frightened people were staying put and seeking reassurance from their comrades. And there was nothing like someone repeating, I'm sure there's no vampire wizards and going to the latrine four times an hour to put backbone into a platoon. Rincewind crept back towards the city, round a tent in the shadows, and collided with a horse, which trod heavily on his foot. Your wife is a big hippo! Sorry! Rincewind froze, both hands clutching his aching foot. He knew only one person with a voice like a cemetery in midwinter. He tried to hop backwards and collided with another horse. Rincewind, isn't it? said Death. Yes. Good evening. 
I don't believe you have met war. Rincewind war. War, Rincewind. War touched his helmet in salute. Pleasure's all mine, he said. He indicated the other three riders. Like to introduce you to my sons, Terror and Panic, and my daughter, Clancy. The children chorused a hello. Clancy was scowling, looking about seven years old, and was wearing a hard hat and a pony club badge. I wasn't expecting to see you here, Rincewind. Oh, good. Death pulled an hourglass out of his robe, held it up to the moonlight, and sighed. Rincewind craned to see how much sand was left. However, I could... Don't you make any special arrangement just on my account, said Rincewind hurriedly. I, um, I expect you're all here for the battle? Yes, it promises to be extremely short. Who's going to win? Now you know I wouldn't tell you that even if I knew. Even if you knew, said Rincewind, I thought you were supposed to know everything. Death held up a finger. Something fluttered down through the night. Rincewind thought it was a moth, although it looked less fluffy and had a strange speckled pattern on its wings. It settled on the extended digit for a moment, and then flew up and away again. On a night like this, said Death, the only certain thing is uncertainty. Trite, I know, but true. Somewhere on the horizon, thunder rumbled. I'll, um, just be sort of going then, said Rincewind. Don't be a stranger, said Death, as the wizard hurried off. Odd person, said War. With him here, even uncertainty is uncertain. And I'm not sure even about that. War pulled a large paper-wrapped package out of his saddlebag. We've got, let's see now, egg and cress, chicken ticker, and mature cheese with crunchy pickle, I think. They do such marvellous things with sandwiches these days. Oh, and bacon surprise. Really? What is so surprising about bacon? I don't know. I suppose it comes as something of a shock to the pig. Ridcully had been having a long wrestle with himself, and had won. We're, um, going to bring him back, he said. It's been four days... And then we can send them back their bloody tube thing. It gives me the, the willies. The senior wizards looked at one another. No one was very keen on a university with a rinse-wind component, but the metal dog did give them the willies. No one had wanted to go near it. They piled some tables around it and tried to pretend it wasn't there. All right, said the dean, but Stibbons kept going on about things weighing the same, right? If we send that back, won't it mean Rincewind arrives here going very fast? Mr. Stibbons says he, he's working on the spell, said Ridcully. Or we could pile some mattresses up at one end of the hall or, or, or something. The bursar raised a hand. Yes, bursar, said Ridcully encouragingly. Ho, oh, landlord, a pint of your finest ale, said the bursar. Uh, good, said Ridcully. That's, um, settled then. I've already told Mr. Stibbons to start looking. On that demonic device? Yes. Then nothing can possibly go wrong, said the dean sourly. A trumpet of lobsters, if you'd be so good. And the bursar agreed. The warlords had gathered in Lord Hong's chambers. They carefully kept a distance from one another, as befitted enemies who were in the most shaky of alliances. Once the barbarians were dealt with, the battle might still continue, but they wanted assurance on one particular point. No, said Lord Hong. Let me make this absolutely clear. There is no invisible army of blood-sucking ghosts, do you understand? The people beyond the wall are just like us, except vastly inferior in every respect, of course, but totally visible. One or two of the lords did not look convinced. And all this talk about the Red Army, said one of them. The Red Army, Lord Tang, is an undisciplined rabble that shall be put down with resolute force. 
You know what the Red Army and the peasants are talking about, said Lord Tang. They say that thousands of years ago, it... They say that thousands of years ago, a wizard who did not exist took mud and lightning and made soldiers that couldn't die, said Lord Hong. Yes, it's a story, Lord Tang. A story made up by peasants who did not understand what really happened. One Sun Mirror's army just had... A Lord Hong waved a hand vaguely. Better armor, better discipline... I'm not frightened of ghosts, and I'm certainly not afraid of a legend that probably never existed. Yes, but soothsayer, snapped Lord Hong. The soothsayer, who hadn't been expecting it, gave a start. Yes, my lord. How are those entrails coming along? Uh, they're, um, they're, they're about ready, my lord, said the soothsayer. The soothsayer was rather worried. This must have been the wrong kind of bird, he told himself. About the only thing the entrails were telling him was that if he got out of this alive, he, the soothsayer, might be lucky enough to enjoy a nice chicken dinner. But Lord Hong sounded like a man with the most dangerous kind of impatience. And what do they tell you? Um, the, the, the future is, um, the, the, the future is... Chicken entrails had never looked like this. For a moment he thought they were moving. Uh, it is... it is... uncertain, he hazarded. Be certain, said Lord Hong. Who will win in the morning? Shadows flickered across the table. Something was fluttering around the light. It looked like an undistinguished yellow moth with black patterns on its wings. The soothsayer's precognitive abilities, which were considerably more powerful than he believed, told him, This is not a good time to be a clairvoyant. On the other hand, there was never a good time to be horribly executed, so, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, he said, the enemy will be most emphatically beaten. How can you be so certain? said Lord McSweeney. The soothsayer bridled. Um, well, you, you see this wobbly bit near the kidneys? Um, you, you want to argue with this green trickly thing? You know all about liver suddenly, all right? So, there you are, said Lord Hong. Fate smiles upon us. Even so, Lord Tang began, the men are very... You can tell the men, Lord Hong began. He stopped. He smiled. You can tell the men, he said, that there is a huge army of invisible vampire ghosts. What? Yes, Lord Hong began to stride up and down, snapping his fingers. Yes, there is a terrible army of foreign ghosts, and this has so enraged our own ghosts. Yes, a thousand generations of our ancestors are riding on the wind to repel this barbaric invasion. The ghosts of the Empire are arising. Millions and millions of them. Even our demons are furious at this intrusion. They will descend like a mist of claws and teeth to... Yes, Lord Sung? The warlords were looking at one another nervously. Are you sure, Lord Hong? Lord Hong's eyes gleamed behind his tiny spectacles. Make the necessary proclamations, he said. But only a few hours ago we told the men there were no... Tell them differently. But will they believe that they... They will believe what they are told, shouted Lord Hong. If the enemy thinks his strength lies in deceit, then we will use their deceit against them. Tell the men that behind them will be a billion ghosts of the Empire. The other warlords tried to avoid his gaze. No one was actually going to suggest that your average soldier would not be totally happy with ghosts front and rear, especially given the capriciousness of ghosts. Good, said Lord Hong. He looked down. Are you still here? Uh, just, just uh, clearing up my, my, my giblets, my lord, squealed the soothsayer. He picked up the remains of his stricken chicken and ran for it. 
After all, he told himself as he pelted back home, it's not as though I said, whose enemy? Lord Hong was left alone. He realized he was shaking. It was probably fury, but perhaps... Perhaps things could be turned to his advantage even so. Barbarians came from outside, and to most people everywhere, outside was the same. Yes, the barbarians were a minute detail, easily disposed of, but carefully managed perhaps might figure in his overall strategy. He was breathing heavily, too. He walked into his private study and shut the door. He pulled out the key. He opened the box. There was a few minutes' silence, except for the rustle of cloth. Then Lord Hong looked at himself in the mirror. He had gone to great lengths to achieve this. He had used several agents, none of whom knew the whole plan. But the Ankh Morpork Taylor had been good at his work, and the measurements had been followed exactly. From pointy boots to hose to doublet, cloak and hat with a feather in it, Lord Hong knew he was a perfect Ankh Morpork gentleman. The cloak was lined with silk. The clothes felt uncomfortable and touched him in unfamiliar ways, but those were minor details. This was how a man looked in a society that breathed, that moved, that could go somewhere. He'd walk through the city on that first great day, and the people would be silent when they saw their natural leader. It never crossed his mind that anyone would say, Here, what a tough, Eve off a brick at him. The ants scurried. The thing that went parp went parp. The wizards stood back. There wasn't much else to do when Hex was working at full speed, except watch the fish and oil the wheels from time to time. There were occasional flashes of octarine from the tubes. Hex was spelling several hundred times a minute. It was as simple as that. It would take a human more than an hour to do an ordinary finding spell, but Hex could do them faster, over and over again. It was netting the whole occult sea in the search of one slippery fish. It achieved, after ninety-three minutes, what would otherwise have taken the faculty several months. You see, said Ponder, his voice shaking a little as he took the line of blocks out of the hopper. I said he could do it. Uh, who's he? said Ridcully. Hex! Oh, you mean it? That's what I said, sir. Uh, yes. Another thing about the horde, Mr. Savaloy had noticed, was their ability to relax. The old men had the cat-like ability to do nothing when there was nothing to do. They'd sharpened their swords, they'd had a meal, big lumps of meat for most of them, and some kind of gruel for Mad Hamish, who dribbled most of it down his beard and assured its wholesomeness by dragging the cook in, nailing him to the floor by his apron, and suspending a large axe on a rope that crossed a beam in the roof and was held at the other end by Cohen, while he ate. Then they sharpened their swords again, out of habit, and stopped. Occasionally one of them would whistle a snatch of a tune through what remained of his teeth, or search a bodily crevice for a particularly fretful louse. Mainly, though, they just sat and stared at nothing. After a long while, Caleb said, You know, I've never been to XXXX. Been everywhere else. Often wondered what it's like. Got shipwrecked there once, said Vincent. Weird place. Lousy with magic. There's beavers with beaks and giant rats with long tails that hops around the place and boxes with one another. Black fellas wandering round all over the place. They say they're in a dream. Bright, though. Show them a bit of desert with one dead tree in it. Next minute they found a three-course meal with fruits and nuts to follow. Beer's good, too. Sounds like it. There was another long pause. Then, I suppose they've got minstrels here. Be a bit of a bloody waste, wouldn't it, if we all got killed and no one made up any songs about it? Bound to have loads of minstrels, a city like this. No problem there, then. No. No. There was another lengthy pause. Not that we're going to get killed. Right. I don't intend to start getting killed at my time of life. <laughs> another pause. Cohen? Yep. You a religious man at all? 
Well, I've robbed lots of temples and killed a few mad priests in my time. Don't know if that counts. What do your tribe believe happens to you when you die in battle? Oh, these big fat women in horned helmets take you off to the halls of Eo, where there is fighting and carousing and quaffing forever. Another pause. You mean like, really, forever? Suppose so. Because generally you get fed up even with turkey by about day four. All right. What do you lot believe? I think we go off to hell in a boat made of toenail clippings. It's something like that anyway. Another long pause. But it's not worth talking about because we're not going to get killed today. You said it. Uh, it's not worth dying if all you've got to look forward to is leftover meat and floating around in a boat smelling of your socks, is it, eh? <laughs> Another pause. Down in Clatch, they believe if you lead a good life, you're rewarded by being sent to a paradise with lots of young women. That's your reward, is it? Don't know. Maybe it's their punishment. But I do remember you eat sherbet all day. Oh, when I was a lad, we had proper sherbet in them little tube things and a licorice straw to suck it up with. You don't get that sort of thing today. People are too busy rushing about. Sounds a lot better than quaffing toenails, though. Another pause. Did you ever believe that business about every enemy you killed becoming your servant in the next world? Dunno. How many you killed? What? Oh, maybe two, three thousand, not counting dwarfs and trolls, of course. Definitely not going to be short of a hairbrush or someone to open doors for you after you're dead, then. A pause. We're definitely not going to die, right? Right. I mean, odds of 100,000 to one. Huh. Difference is just a lot of zeros, right? Right. I mean, stout comrades at our side, a strong right arm. What more could we want? Pause. A volcano would be favourite. Pause. We're going to die, aren't we? Yep. The horde looked at one another. Still, to look on the bright side, I recall I still owe Fuffa the dwarf fifty dollars for this sword, said Boy Willie. Looks as though I could end up ahead of the game. Mr. Savaloy put his head in his hands. I'm really sorry, he said. Don't worry about it, said Cohen. The grey light of dawn was just visible in the high windows. Look, said Mr. Savaloy, you don't have to die. We could, well, we could sneak out. Back along the pipe, maybe. Perhaps we could carry Hamish. People are coming and going all the time. I'm sure we could get out of the city without any... His voice faded away. No voice could keep going under the pressure of those stairs. Even Hamish, whose gaze was generally focused on some point about eighty years away, was glaring at him. He ain't gonna run, said Hamish. It's not uh, a running away, he managed. It's a sensible withdrawal. Tactics. <laughs> Good grief, it's common sense. Ain't gonna run. Look, even barbarians can count, and you've admitted you're going to die. Ain't gonna run. Cohen leaned forward and patted Mr. Savaloy on the head. It's the heroing, see, he said. Who's ever heard of a hero running away? All them kids you was telling us about. You know, the ones who think we're stories. You reckon they'd believe we ran away? Well, then. No, it's not part of the old deal, running away. Let someone else do the running. Besides, said Truckle, where would we get another chance like this? Six against five armies. That's blood. That that's fantastic. We're not talking legends here. I reckon we've got a good crack at some mythology as well. But um, you'll die. 
Oh, that's part of it, I'll grant you, that's part of it. But what a way to go, eh? Mr. Savaloy looked at them and realised that they were speaking another language in another world. It was one he had no key to, no map for. You could teach them to wear interesting pants and handle money, but something in their soul stayed exactly the same. Do teachers go anywhere special when they die? said Cohen. I don't think so, said Mr. Savaloy gloomily. He wondered for a moment whether there really was a great free period in the sky. It didn't sound very likely. Probably there would be some marking to do. Well, whatever happens when you're dead, if you ever feel like a good quaff, you're welcome to drop in at any time, said Cohen. It's been fun. That's the important thing, and it's been an education, hasn't it, boys? There was a general murmur of assent. Amazing, all those long words. And learning to buy things. And social intercourse. <laughs> Sorry. What? Shame it didn't work out, but I've never been one for plans, said Cohen. Mr. Savaloy stood up. I'm going to join you, he said grimly. What, to fight? Yes. Do you know how to handle a sword, said Truckle? Er, uh, no. Then you've wasted all your life. Mr. Savaloy looked offended at this. I expect I'll get the hang of it as we go along, he said. Get the hang of it? It's a sword. Yes, but when you're a teacher, you have to pick things up fast, Mr. Savaloy smiled nervously. I once taught practical alchemy for a whole term when Mr. Schism was off sick after blowing himself up, and up until then I'd never even seen a crucible. Here, Boy Willie handed the teacher a spare sword. He hefted it. Uh, I expect there's a, a, a manual or something? Manual? No, you hold the blunt end and poke the other end at people. Ah, oh, really? Well, that seems quite straightforward. I thought there was rather more to it than that. You sure you want to come with us? said Cohen. Mr. Savaloy looked firm. Absolutely. I very much doubt if I'll survive if you lose, and, well, it seems that you heroes get a better class of heaven. I must say, I rather suspect you get a better class of life, too, and I really don't know where teachers go when they're dead, but I've got a horrible suspicion it'll be full of sports masters. It's just that I don't know if you could really go properly, Berserk, said Cohen. Have you ever had the red mist come down and woke up to find you'd bitten twenty people to death? I used to be reckoned a pretty ratty man if people made too much noise in class, said Mr. Savaloy, and something of a dead shot with a piece of chalk, too. How about you, taxman? Six beneficent winds backed away hurriedly. I... I think I'm probably more cut out for undermining the system from within, he said. Fair enough, Cohen looked at the others. I've never done this official sort of war ring before, he said. How's it supposed to go? I think you just line up in front of one another and then charge, said Mr. Savaloy. Seems straightforward enough. All right, let's go. They strode, or in one case wheeled, and in another case moved at Mr. Savaloy's gentle trot down the hall. The taxman trailed after them. Mr. Savaloy, he shouted. You know what's going to happen. Have you lost your senses? Yes, said the teacher, but I may have found some better ones. He grinned to himself. The whole of his life so far had been complicated. There had been timetables and lists, and a whole basket of things he must do and things he shouldn't do, and the life of Mr. Savaloy had been this little wriggly thing trying to survive in the middle of it all. But now it had suddenly all become very simple. You held one end and you poked the other into people. A man could live his whole life by a maxim like that, and afterwards get a very interesting afterlife. Here, you'll need this too, said Caleb, poking something round at him as they stepped into the grey light. It's a shield. Ah, it's to protect myself, yes? If you really need to, bite the edge. Oh, I know about that, said Mr. Savaloy. That's when you go berserk, right? Could be, could be, said Caleb. 
That's why a lot of fighters do it. But personally, I do it because it's made of chocolate. Chocolate? You can never get a proper meal in these battles. And this is me, thought Mr. Savaloy, marching down the street with the heroes. They are the great fighters. And when in doubt, take all your clothes off, said Caleb. What for? Sign of a good berserk, taking all your clothes off. Frightens the hell out of the enemy. If anyone starts laughing, stab em one. There was a movement among the blankets in the wheelchair. What? I said stab em one, Hamish. Hamish waved an arm that looked like bone with skin on it, and apparently far too thin to hold the axe he was in fact holding. That's right. A right in the nadgers. Mr. Savaloy nudged Caleb. I ought to be writing this down, he said. Where exactly are the nadgers? Small range of mountains near the hub. Oh, fascinating. The citizens of Hung Hung were ranged along the city walls. It was not every day you saw a fight like this. Rincewind elbowed and kicked his way through the people until he reached the cadre, who'd managed to occupy a prime position over the main gate. What are you hanging around here for? he said. You could be miles away. We want to see what happens, of course, said Two Flower, his spectacles gleaming. I know what happens. The horde will be instantly slaughtered, said Rincewind. What did you expect to happen? Ah, but you're forgetting the invisible vampire ghosts, said Two Flower. Rincewind looked at him. What? Their secret army. I've heard that we've got some too. Should be interesting to watch. Two Flower, there are no invisible vampire ghosts. Ah, yes. Everyone's going round denying it, said Lotus Blossom. So there must be some truth in it. But I made it up. Ah, you may think you made it up, said Two Flower, but perhaps you are a pawn of fate. Listen, there's no same old rinse wind, said Two Flower in a jolly way. You always were so pessimistic about everything, but it always worked out all right in the end. There are no ghosts, there are no magic armies, said Rincewind. There's just when seven men go out to fight an army one hundred thousand times bigger. There's only one way it can end, said Two Flower. Right, I'm glad you see sense. They'll win, said Two Flower. They've got to, otherwise the world's just not working properly. You look educated, said Rincewind to Butterfly. Explain to him why he's wrong. It's because of a little thing we have in our country. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's called mathematics. The girl smiled at him. You don't believe me, do you? said Rincewind flatly. You're just like him. What do you think this is? Homeopathic warfare? The smaller your side, the more likely you are to win. Well, it's not like that. I wish it was like that, but it isn't. Nothing is. There are no amazing strokes of luck, no magic solutions, and the good people don't win because they're small and plucky. He waved his hand irritably at something. You always survived, said Two Flower. We had amazing adventures, and you always survived. That was just coincidence. You kept on surviving. And you got us safely out of prison, said Lotus Blossom. There were just a lot of coincidence. Will you go away? A butterfly skittered away from his flailing hand. Damn things, he mumbled, and added, Well, that's it. I'm off. I can't watch. I've got things to do. Besides, afterwards, I think nasty people are going to be looking for me. And then he realized there were tears in Lotus Blossom's eyes. We... we thought you would do something, she said. Me? I can't do anything, especially not magic. I'm famous for it. Don't go around believing that great wizards solve all your problems because there aren't any and they don't, and I should know because I'm not one. He backed away. This is always happening to me. I'm just minding my own business and everything goes wrong and suddenly everyone's relying on me and saying, Oh, Rincewind, what are you going to do about it? Well, what Mrs. Rincewind's little boy, if she was a Mrs. Rincewind, of course, what he's going to do about it is nothing, right? You have to sort it all out yourselves. No mysterious magical armies are going to... Will you stop looking at me like that? I don't see why it's my fault. I've got other things to do. It's not my business. And then he turned and ran. The crowds didn't take much notice of him. 
The streets were deserted by Hong Kong standards, which means you could quite often see the cobbles. Rincewind pushed and shoved his way along the alleys nearest the wall, looking for another gateway with guards too busy to ask questions. There were footsteps behind him. Look, he said, spinning round. I told you, you can all... It was the luggage. It contrived to look a little ashamed of itself. Oh, turned up at last, have we? said Rincewind savagely. What happened to the following master everywhere thing? The luggage shuffled its feet. From out of an alleyway came a slightly larger and far more ornate version of itself. Its lid was inset with decorative wood, and it seemed to Rincewind its feet were rather more dainty than the horny nailed calloused ones of the luggage. Besides, the toenails had been painted. Oh, he said. Well, good grief. Fair enough, I suppose. Really? I mean, yes. Well, come on then. He reached the end of the alley and turned round. The luggage was gently bumping the larger chest, urging it to follow him. Rincewind's own sexual experiences were not excessive, although he had seen diagrams. He hadn't the faintest idea about how it applied to travel accessories. Did they say things like, What a chest, or Get a load of the hinges on that one? If it came to that, he had no real reason for considering that the luggage was male. Admittedly, it had a homicidal nature, but so had a lot of the women that Rincewind had met, and they'd often become a little more homicidal as a result of meeting him. Capacity for violence, Rincewind had heard, was unisexual. He wasn't sure what unisex was, but he expected that it was what he normally experienced. There was a small gate ahead. It seemed to be unguarded. Despite his fear, he walked through it and refrained from running. Authority always noticed a running man. The time to start running was around the E in Hey You. No one paid him any attention. The attention of the people along the wall was on the armies. Look at them, he said bitterly to the generality of the universe. Stupid. If it was seven against seventy, everyone would know who'd lose. Just because it's seven against seven hundred thousand, everyone's not so sure. As though suddenly numbers don't mean anything anymore. <laughs> Why should I do anything? It's not as if I even know the guy that well. Admittedly, he saved my life a couple of times, but that's no reason to die horribly just because he can't count. So you can stop looking at me like that. The luggage backed away a little. The other luggage. Rincewind supposed it just looked female. Women had bigger luggage than men, didn't they? Because of the... he moved into unknown territory. Extra frills and stuff. It was just one of those things, like the fact that they had smaller handkerchiefs than men, even though their noses were generally the same size. The luggage had always been the luggage. Rincewind wasn't mentally prepared for there to be more than one. There was the luggage, and the other luggage. Come on, both of you, he said. We're getting out of here. I've done what I can, I just don't care anymore. It's nothing to do with me. I don't see why everyone depends on me. I'm not dependable. Even I don't depend on me, and I'm me. Cohen looked at the horizon. Grey-blue clouds were piling up. Is a storm coming? he said. It's a mercy that we won't be alive to get wet then, said Boy Willie cheerfully. Funny thing, though, it looks like it's coming from every direction at once. Filthy foreign weather. You can't trust it. Cohen turned his attention to the armies of the five warlords. There seemed to have been some agreement. They'd arranged themselves around the position that Cohen had taken up. The tactic seemed quite clear. It was simply to advance. The horde could see the commanders riding up and down in front of their legions. How's it supposed to start? said Cohen, the rising wind whipping at what remained of his hair. Does someone blow a whistle or something? Or do we just scream and charge? Commencement is generally by agreement, said Mr. Savaloy. Oh! Cohen looked at the forest of lances and pennants. Hundreds of thousands of men looked like quite a lot of men when you saw them close to. I suppose, he said slowly, that none of you has got some amazing plan you've been keeping quiet about? We thought you had one, said Truckle. Several riders had now left each army and approached the horde in a group. They stopped a little more than a spear's throw away and sat and watched. All right, then, said Cohen. I hate to say this, but perhaps... We should talk about surrender. No, 
said Mr. Savaloy, and then stopped in embarrassment at the loudness of his own voice. No, he repeated a little more quietly. You won't live if you surrender. You just won't die immediately. Cohen scratched his nose. What's that flag, you know, when you want to talk to them without them killing you? It's got to be red, said Mr. Savaloy. But look, it's no good. You know. I don't know, red for surrender, white for funerals, muttered Cohen. All right. Anyone got something red? I've got a handkerchief, said Mr. Savaloy, but it's, it's white. And anyway, give it here. The barbarian teacher very reluctantly handed it over. Cohen pulled a small worn knife from his belt. I don't believe this, said Mr. Savaloy. He was nearly in tears. Cohen the Barbarian talking surrender with people like that. Influence of civilization, said Cohen. It's probably made me go soft in the head. He pulled the knife over his arm and then clamped the handkerchief over the cut. There we are, he said. Soon have a nice red flag. The horde nodded approvingly. It was an amazingly symbolic, dramatic, and above all, stupid gesture in the finest traditions of barbarian heroing. It didn't seem to be lost on some of the nearest soldiers, either. Now, Cohen went on, I reckon you, Teach, and you, Truckle, you two come with me, and we'll go and talk to these people. They'll drag you off to their dungeons, said Mr. Savaloy. They've got torturers that can keep you alive for years. What? What's he say? He said they can keep you alive for years in their dungeons, Amish. Good. Fine by me. Oh, dear, said Mr. Savaloy. He trailed after the other two towards the warlords. Lord Hong raised his visor and stared down his nose at them as they approached. Red flag, look, said Cohen, waving the rather damp object on the end of his sword. Yes, said Lord Hong, we saw that little show. It may impress the common soldiers, but it does not impress me, barbarian. Please yourself, said Cohen. We've come to talk about surrender. Mr. Savaloy noticed some of the lesser lords relax a little. Then he thought, a real soldier probably doesn't like this sort of thing. You don't want to go to soldier heaven or wherever you go and say... I once led an army against seven old men. It wasn't medal-winning material. Ah, of course. So much for bravado, said Lord Hong. Then lay down your arms, and you will be escorted back to the palace. Cohen and Truckle looked at one another. Sorry, said Cohen. Lay down your arms, Lord Hong snorted. That means put down your weapons. Cohen gave him a puzzled look. Why should we put down our weapons? Are we not talking about your surrender? Our surrender? Mr. Savaloy's mouth opened in a mad, slow grin. Lord Hong stared at Cohen. <laughs> you can hardly expect me to believe that you have come to ask us. He leaned from the saddle and glared at them. You do, don't you, he said. You mindless little barbarians. Is it true that you can only count up to five? We just thought it might save people getting hurt, said Cohen. You thought it would save you getting hurt, said the warlord. I dare say a few of yours might get hurt too. They're peasants, said the warlord. Oh, yes, I was forgetting that, said Cohen. And you're their chief, right? It's like your game of chess, right? I am their lord, said Lord Hong. They will die at my bidding, if necessary. Cohen gave him a big, dangerous grin. When do we start, he said. Return to your band, said Lord Hong, and then I think we shall start. Shortly. He glared at Truckle, who was unfolding his bit of paper. The barbarian's lips moved awkwardly, and he ran a horny finger across the page. This begotten wretch, so you are, he said. My word, 
said Mr. Saveloy, who'd created the look-up table. As the three returned to the hoard, Mr. Saveloy was aware of a grinding sound. Cohen was wearing several carrots off his teeth. Die at my bidding, he said. The bugger doesn't even know what a chief is meant to be, the bastard. Him and his horse. Mr. Saveloy looked around. There seemed to be some arguing among the warlords. You know, he said, they probably will try to take us alive. I used to have a headmaster like him. He liked to make people's lives a misery. You mean they'll be trying not to kill us, said Truckle. Yes. Does that mean we have to try not to kill them? No, I don't think so. Sounds okay to me. What do we do now? said Mr. Savaloy. Do we do a battle chant or something? We just wait, said Cohen. There's a lot of waiting in warfare, said Boy Willie. Ah, yes, said Mr. Savaloy. I've heard people say that. They say there's long periods of boredom followed by short periods of excitement. Not really, said Cohen. It's more like short periods of waiting followed by long periods of being dead. Blast. The fields were crisscrossed with drainage ditches. There seemed to be no straight path anywhere, and the ditches were too wide to jump. They looked shallow enough to wade, but only because eighteen inches of water overlay a suffocating depth of rich, thick mud. Mr. Savaloy said that the Empire owed its prosperity to the mud of the plains, and right now Rincewind was feeling extremely rich. He was also quite close to the big hill that dominated the city. It really was rounded, with a precision apparently far too accurate for mere natural causes. Savaloy had said that hills like that were drumlins, great piles of topsoil left behind by glaciers. Trees covered the lower slopes of this one, and there was a small building on the top. Cover. Now, that was a good word. It was a big plain, and the armies weren't too far away. The hill looked curiously peaceful, as if it belonged to a different world. It was strange that the Agateans, who otherwise seemed to farm absolutely everywhere a water buffalo could stand, had left it alone. Someone was watching him. It was a water buffalo. It would be wrong to say it watched him with interest, it just watched him, because its eyes were open and had to be facing in some direction, and it had randomly chosen one which included Rincewind. Its face held the completely serene expression of a creature that had long ago realized that it was fundamentally a tube on legs, and had been installed in the universe to, broadly speaking, achieve throughput. At the other end of the string was a man ankle-deep in the mud of the field. He had a broad straw hat, like every other buffalo holder. He had the basic pyjama suit of the Agatean man in the field, and he had an expression not of idiocy, but of preoccupation. He was looking at Rincewind. As with the buffalo, this was only because his eyes had to be doing something. Despite the pressing dangers, Rincewind found himself overcome by a sudden curiosity. Er, uh, good morning, he said. The man gave him a nod. The water buffalo made the sound of regurgitating cud. Um, sorry if this is a personal question, said Rincewind, but I can't help wondering, why do you stand out in the fields all day with the water buffalo? The man thought about it. Good for soil, he said eventually. But doesn't it waste a lot of time, said Rincewind? The man gave this due appraisal also. What's time to a cow, he said. Rincewind reversed back onto the highway of reality. You see those armies over there, he said. The buffalo holder concentrated his gaze. Yes, he decided. They're fighting for you. The man did not appear moved by this. The water buffalo burped gently. Some want to see you enslaved, and some want you to run the country, or at least to let them run the country while telling you it's you doing it really, said Rincewind. There's going to be a terrible battle. I can't help wondering, what do you want? The buffalo holder absorbed this one for consideration too, and it seemed to Rincewind that the slowness of the thought process wasn't due to native stupidity, but more to do with the sheer size of the question. He could feel it spreading out so that it incorporated the soil and the grass of the sun and headed on out into the universe. Finally, the man said, a longer piece of string would be nice. Oh, really? 
Well, well, there's a thing, said Rincewind. Talking to you has been an education. Goodbye. The man watched him go. Beside him, the buffalo relaxed some muscles and contracted others and lifted its tail and made the world, in a very small way, a better place. Rincewind headed on towards the hill. Random as the animal tracks and occasional plank bridges were, they seemed to head right for it. If Rincewind had been thinking clearly, an activity he last remembered doing around the age of twelve, he might have wondered about that. The trees of the lower slopes were sapient pears, and he didn't even think about that. Their leaves turned to watch him as he scrambled past. What he needed now was a cave or a handy... He paused. Oh, no, he said. No, 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 you don't catch me like that. I'll go into a handy cave and there'll be a little door or some wise old man or something and I'll be dragged back into events. Right. Stay out in the open. That's the style. He half climbed, half walked to the rounded top of the hill, which rose above the trees like a dome. Now he was closer. He could see that it wasn't as smooth as it looked from below. Weather had worn gullies and channels in the soil and bushes had colonized every sheltered slope. The building on the top was, to Rincewind's surprise, rusty. It had been made of iron, pointed iron roof, iron walls, iron doorway. There were a few old nests and some debris on the floor, but it was otherwise empty, and not a good place to hide. It would be the first place anyone would look. There was a cloud wall around the world now. Lightning crackled in its heart, and there was the sound of thunder, not the gentle rumble of summer thunder, but the crack, crack, crack of splitting sky. And yet the heat wrapped the plain like a blanket. The air felt thick. In a minute it was going to rain cats and food. Find somewhere where I won't be noticed, he muttered. Keep head down, only way. Why should I care? Other people's problem. Panting in the oppressive heat, he wandered on. Lord Hong was enraged. Those who knew him could tell by the way he spoke more slowly and smiled continuously. And how do the men know the lightning dragons are angry, he said. It may be mere high spirits. Not with a sky that color, said Lord Tang. That is not an auspicious color for a sky. It looks like a bruise. A sky like that is portentous. And what, pray, do you think it portends? It's just generally portentous. I know what's behind this, Lord Hong snarled. You are too frightened to fight seven old men, is that it? The men say they're the legendary seven indestructible sages, said Lord Fang. He tried to smile. You know how superstitious they are. What seven sages, said Lord Hong. I am extremely familiar with the history of the world, and there are no legendary seven indestructible sages. Um... Not yet, said Lord Fang. Uh, but a day like this, perhaps legends have to start somewhere. The barbarians! Oh, gods! Seven men! Can I believe we're afraid of seven men? It feels wrong, said Lord McSweeney. He added quickly, that's what the men say. You have made the proclamation about our celestial army of ghosts. All of you? The warlords tried to avoid his gaze. Uh, yes, said Lord Fang. That must have improved morale. Uh, not entirely. What do you mean, man? Uh, many men have deserted. Um, they've been saying that foreign ghosts were bad enough, but... But what? They are soldiers, Lord Hong said Lord Tang sharply. They all have people they do not want to meet, don't you? Just for a second, there was the suggestion of a twitch on Lord Hong's cheek. It was only for a second, but those who saw it took note. Lord Hong's renowned glaze had shown a crack. What would you do, Lord Tang? Let these insolent barbarians go? Of course not, but... You don't need an army against seven men, seven ancient old men. The peasants say they 
See? Lord Hong's voice was slightly higher. Come on, man. Who talks to peasants? I'm sure you're going to tell us what they say about these foolhardy and foolish old men. Well, that's it, you see. They say if they're so foolish and foolhardy, how did they manage to become so old? Luck. It was the wrong word. Even Lord Hong realized it. He'd never believed in luck. He'd always taken pains, usually those of other people, to fill life with certainties. But he knew that others believed in luck. It was a foible he'd always been happy to make use of, and now it was turning and stinging him on the hand. There is nothing in the art of war to tell us how five armies attack seven old men," said Lord Tang. "Ghosts or no ghosts, and this Lord Hong is because no one ever thought such a thing would be done." If you feel so frightened, I'll ride out against them with my mere two hundred and fifty thousand men," he said. "I'm not frightened," said Lord Tang. "I am ashamed." Each man armed with two swords," Lord Hong went on, ignoring him. "And I shall see how lucky these sages are, because, my lords, I will only have to be lucky once. They will all have to be lucky." A quarter of a million times. He lowered his visor. How lucky do you feel, my lords? The other four warlords avoided one another's gaze. Lord Hong noticed their resigned silence. Very well then, he said. Let the gongs be sounded and the firecrackers lit, to ensure good luck, of course. There were a large number of ranks in the armies of the empire, and many of them were untranslatable. Three pink pig and five white fang were loosely speaking privates, and not just because they were pale, vulnerable, and inclined to curl up and hide when danger threatened. In fact, they were so private as to be downright secretive. Even the army's mules ranked higher than them, because good mules were hard to come by, whereas men like pink pig and white fang are found in every army, somewhere where a latrine is in need of cleaning. They were so insignificant that they had privately decided that it would be a waste of an invisible foreign blood-sucking ghost's valuable time to attack them. They felt it only fair, after it had come all this way, to give it the chance of fiendishly killing someone superior. They had therefore hospitably decamped just before dawn and were now hiding out. Of course, if victory threatened, they could always recamp. It was unlikely that they'd be missed in all the excitement, and both men were somewhat expert at turning up on battlefields in time to join in the victory celebrations. They lay in the long grass, watching the armies manoeuvre. From this height, it looked like an impressive war. The army on one side was so small as to be invisible. Of course, if you accepted the very strong denials of last night, it was so invisible as to be invisible. It was also their elevation, which meant that they were the first to notice the ring around the sky. It was just above the thunderous wall on the horizon, where stray shafts of sunlight hit it. It glowed golden. Elsewhere, it was merely yellow, but it was continuous and thin as a thread. Funny looking cloud," said White Fang. "Yeah," said Pink Pig. "So what?" It was while they were thus engaged and sharing a small bottle of rice wine, liberated by Pink Pig from an unsuspecting comrade the previous evening, that they heard a groan. <sighs> their drinks froze in their throats. Did you hear that? said Pink Pig. You mean the? <sighs> That's it. They turned very slowly. Something had pulled itself out of a gully behind them. It was humanoid, more or less. Red mud dripped from it. Strange noises issued from its mouth. Oh shit! Pink Pig grabbed White Fang's arm. It's an invisible blood-sucking ghost. But I can see it. Pink Pig squinted. It's the Red Army. They've come up out of the earth, like everybody says. White Fang, who had several brain cells more than Pink Pig, and more importantly was only on his second cup of wine, took a closer look. It could be just one ordinary man with mud all over him," he suggested. He raised his voice. "Hey, you!" The figure turned and tried to run. Pink Pig nudged his friend. "Is he one of ours? Looking like that? Let's get him. Why? 'Cause he's running away."
Let him run. Maybe he's got money. Anyway, what's he running away for? Rincewind slid down into another gully. Of all the luck, soldiers should be where they were expected to be. What had happened to duty and honour and stuff like that? The gully had dead grass and moss in the bottom. He stood still and listened to the voices of the two men. The air was stifling. It was as if the oncoming storm was pushing all the hot air in front of it, turning the plane into a pressure cooker. And then the ground creaked and sagged suddenly. The faces of the absentee soldiers appeared over the edge of the gully. There was another creak, and the ground sank another inch or two. Rincewind didn't dare breathe in in case the extra weight of air made him too heavy, and it was very clear that the least activity, such as jumping, was going to make things worse. Very carefully, he looked down. The dead moss had given away. He seemed to be standing on a bulk of timber buried in the ground, but dirt pouring all around it suggested that there was a hole beneath. It was going to give way any second. Rincewind threw himself forward. The ground fell away underneath, so that instead of standing on a slowly breaking piece of timber, he was hanging with his arms over what felt like another concealed log, and by the feel of it, one which was as riddled with rot as the first one. This one, possibly out of a desire to conform, began to sag, and then jolted to a stop. The faces of the soldiers vanished backwards as the sides of the gully began to slide. Dry earth and small stones slid past Rincewind. He could feel them rattle on his boots and drop away. He felt, as an expert in these things, that he was over a depth. From his point of view, it was also a height. The log began to shift again. This left Rincewind with, as he saw it, two options. He could let go and plunge to an uncertain fate in the darkness, or he could hang on until the timber gave way and then plunge to an uncertain fate in the darkness. And then, to his delight, there was a third option. The toe of his boot touched something, a root, a protruding rock. It didn't matter. It took some of his weight. It took at least enough to put him in precarious equilibrium, not exactly safe, not exactly falling. Of course, it was only a temporary measure, but Rincewind had always considered that life was no more than a series of temporary measures strung together. A pale yellow butterfly, with interesting patterns on its wing, fluttered along the gully and settled on the only bit of colour available— which turned out to be Rincewind's hat. The wood sagged slightly. Push off, said Rincewind, trying not to use heavy language. Go away. The butterfly flattened its wings and sunned itself. Rincewind pursed his lips and tried to blow up his own nostrils. Startled, the creature skittered into the air. Ha, huh, said Rincewind, and, in response to its instincts in the face of threat, moved its wings like this, this. The bushes shivered, and around the sky the towering clouds curved into unusual patterns. Another cloud formed. It was about the size of an angry grey balloon, and it started to rain. Not rain generally, but specifically. Specifically on about a square foot of ground, which contained rincewind. Specifically on his hat. A very small bolt of lightning stung rincewind on the nose. Ah! So we have... Pink Pig, appearing round the curve of the gully, hesitated a bit before continuing, slightly more thoughtfully, a head in a hole with a very small thunderstorm above it. And then it dawned on him that, storm or no storm, nothing was preventing him from cutting off significant parts. The only significant part available was a head, but that was fine by him. At which point... Rincewind's hat having absorbed enough moisture, the ancient wood gave way under the strain and plunged him to an uncertain fate in the darkness. It was utterly dark. There had been a painful confusion of tunnels and sliding dirt. Rincewind assumed, or the small part of him that was not sobbing with fear assumed, that the earth had caved in after him. Cave. That was a significant word. He was in a cave. Reaching out carefully in case he felt something, he felt for something to feel. There was a straight edge. It led to three more straight edges going off at right angles. So, this meant slab. The darkness was still a choking velvet shroud. Slab meant that there was some other entrance, some proper entrance. Even now, guards were probably hurrying towards him. Perhaps the luggage was hurrying towards them. It had been acting very funny lately, that was for certain. He was probably better off without it. Probably. 
He patted his pockets, saying the mantra that even non-wizards invoke in order to find matches. That is, he said, matches, 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 madly to himself under his breath. He found some and scratched one desperately with his thumbnail. Ow! The smoky yellow flame lit nothing except Rincewind's hand and part of his sleeve. He ventured a few steps before it burned his fingers, and when it did, it left a blue afterglow in the darkness of his vision. There were no sounds of vengeful feet. There were no sounds at all. In theory, there should be the drip of water, but the air felt quite dry. He tried another match, and this time raised it as high as he could and peered ahead. A seven-foot warrior smiled at him. Cohen looked up again. It's going to piss down in a minute, he said. Will you look at that sky? There were hints of purple and red in the mass, and the occasional momentary glow of lightning somewhere inside the clouds. Teach? Yes? You know everything. Why is that cloud looking like that? Mr. Savaloy looked where Cohen was pointing. There was a yellowish cloud low on the horizon. Right around the horizon, one thin streak, as though the sun was trying to find a way through. Could be the lining, said Boy Willie. What lining? Every cloud's supposed to have a silver one. Yeah, but that's more like gold. Well, gold's cheaper here. Is it me, said Mr. Savaloy, or is it getting wider? Caleb was staring at the enemy lines. There's been a lot of blokes galloping about on their little horses, he said. I hope they get a move on. We don't want to be here all day. I vote we rush them while they're not expecting it, said Hamish. Hold on, hold on, said Truckle. It was the sound of many gongs being beaten and the cracking of fireworks. Looks like the bast the love childs are moving. Thank goodness for that, said Cohen. He stood up and stubbed out his cigarette. Mr. Savaloy trembled with excitement. Do we sing a song for the gods before we go into battle, he said. You can if you like, said Cohen. Well, do we say any heathen chants or prayers? Shouldn't think so, said Cohen. He glanced up at the horizon-girdling band. It was unsettling him far more than the approaching enemy. It was wider now, but slightly paler. For just a moment he found himself wishing that there was one god or goddess somewhere whose temple he hadn't violated, robbed, or burned down. "'Don't we bang our swords on our shields and utter defiance?' said the teacher, hopefully. "'Too late for that, really,' said Cohen. Mr. Savaloy looked so crestfallen at the lack of pagan splendour that the ancient barbarian was, to his own surprise, moved to add, "'But feel free, if that's what you want.' The horde drew their various swords. In Hamish's case, another axe was produced from under his rug. "'See you in heaven,' said Mr. Savaloy excitedly. "'Yeah, right,' said Caleb, eyeing the line of approaching soldiers. "'Where there's feasting and young ladies and so forth.' "'Yeah, yeah,' said Boy Willie, testing the blade of his sword. "'And carousing and quaffing, I believe.' "'Could be,' said Vincent, trying to ease the tendinitis in his arm. "'And we'll do that thing, you know, where you throw the axes and cut ladies' plats off.' "'Yeah, if you like.' "'But what?' "'The actual feasting. Do they do anything vegetarian?' And the advancing army screamed and charged. They rushed at the horde almost as fast as the clouds boiling in from every direction. Rincewind's brain unfroze slowly in the darkness and silence of the hill. It's a statue, he told himself. That's all it is. No problem there. Not even a particularly good one. Just a big statue of a man in armour. Look, there's a couple more. You can just see them at the edge of the light. Ow! He dropped the match and sucked his fingers. What he needed now was a wall. Walls had exits. True, they could also be entrances, but now there didn't seem much danger of any guards hurrying in here. The air had an ancient smell, with a hint of fox and a slight trace of thunderstorms, but above all, it tasted unused. He crept forward, testing each step with his foot. Then there was light. A small blue spark jumped off Rincewind's finger. Cohen grabbed at his beard. It was straining away from his face. Mr. Savaloy's fringe of hair stood out from his head and sparked at the ends. 
Static discharges, he shouted above the crackle. Ahead of them, the spears of the enemy glowed at the tips. The charge faltered. There was the occasional shriek as sparks leapt from man to man. Cohen looked up. Oh my, he said. Will you look at that? Tiny sparks flickered around Rincewind as he eased himself over the unseen floor. The word tomb had presented itself for his consideration, and one thing Rincewind knew about large tombs was that their builders were often jolly inventive in the traps and spikes department. They also put in things like paintings and statues, possibly so that the dead had something to look at if they became bored. Rincewind's hand touched stone, and he moved carefully sideways. Now and again his feet touched something yielding and soft. He very much hoped it was mud. And then, right at hand height, was a lever. It stuck out fully two feet. Now, it could be a trap, but traps were generally, well, traps. The first you knew about them was when your head was rolling along the corridor several yards away. And trap builders tended to be straightforwardly homicidal and seldom required victims to actively participate in their own destruction. Rincewind pulled it. The yellow cloud sailed overhead in its millions, moving much faster on the wind they'd created than the slow beating of their wings would suggest. Behind them came the storm. Mr. Savaloy blinked. Butterflies? Both sides stopped as the creatures sleeted past. It was even possible to hear the rustle of their wings. All right, Teach, said Cohen. Explain this one. It, uh, it, 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 it could be a natural phenomenon, said Mr. Savaloy. Um, monarch butterflies, for example, have been known to, uh, uh, to tell you the truth, I don't know. The cloud swarmed on towards the hill. Not some kind of sign, said Cohen. There must have been some temple I didn't rob. The trouble with signs and portents, said Boy Willie, is you never know who they're for. This one could be a nice one for Hong and his pals. Then I'm nicking it, said Cohen. You can't steal a message from the gods, said Mr. Savaloy. Can you see it nailed down anywhere? No? Sure. Right. So it's mine. He raised his sword as the stragglers fluttered past overhead. The gods smile on us, he bellowed. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 whispered Mr. Savaloy. Just to worry him, said Cohen. He glanced at the other members of the horde. Each man nodded very slightly. All right, lads, he said quietly. This is it. Um, what do I do? said Mr. Savaloy. Think of something to make yourself good and angry. That gets the old blood boiling. Imagine the enemy is everything you hate. Head teachers, said Mr. Savaloy. Good. Sports masters, shouted Mr. Savaloy. Yep. Boys who chew gum, screamed Mr. Savaloy. Look at him. Steam coming out of his ears already, said Cohen. First one to the afterlife gets him in. Charge! The yellow cloud thronged up the slopes of the hill and then, carried on the uprising wind, rose. Above it, the storm rose too, piling up and up and spreading into a shape, something like a hammer. It struck. Lightning hit the iron pagoda so hard that it exploded into white-hot fragments. It is confusing for an entire army to be attacked by seven old men. No book of tactics is up to the task of offering advice. There is a tendency towards bafflement. The soldiers backed away in the face of the rush, and then, driven by currents in the great mass of men, closed in behind. A solid circle of shields surrounded the horde. It buckled and swayed under the press of men, and also under the blows rained on it by Mr. Savaloy's sword. Come on, fight, he shouted. Smoke pipes at me, would you? You, that boy there, answer me back, eh? Take that. Cohen looked at Caleb, who shrugged. He'd seen berserk rages in his time, but nothing quite so incandescent as Mr. Savaloy. The circle broke as a couple of men tried to dart backwards and cannoned into the rank behind, and then rebounded onto the swords of the horde. One of Hamish's wheels caught a soldier with a vicious blow on the knee, and as he bent over, one of Hamish's axes met him coming the other way. It wasn't speed. The horde couldn't move very fast, but it was economy. Mr. Savaloy had remarked on it. 
They were simply always where they wanted to be, which was never where somebody's sword was. They let everyone else do the running around. A soldier would risk a slash in the direction of Truckle and find Cohen rising in front of him, grinning and swinging, or Boy Willie giving him a nod of acknowledgement and a stab. Occasionally, one of the horde took time to parry a blow aimed at Mr. Savaloy, who was far too excited to defend himself. Pull back, you bloody fools! Lord Hong appeared behind the throng, his horse rearing, his helmet visor flung back. The soldiers tried to obey. Finally, the press eased a little and then opened. The horde were left in a widening ring of shields. There was something like silence, broken only by the endless thunder and the crackle of lightning on the hill. And then, pushing their way angrily through the soldiers, came an altogether different breed of warrior. They were taller and heavier armoured, with splendid helmets and moustaches that looked like a declaration of war in themselves. One of them glared at Cohen. What's that? said Cohen. He's a samurai, said Mr. Savaloy, wiping his forehead. The warrior caste. I think that's their formal challenge. Um, would you like me to fight him? One samurai glared at Cohen. He pulled a scrap of silk out of his armour and tossed it into the air. The other hand grabbed the hilt of his long, thin sword. There was hardly even a hiss, but three shreds of silk tumbled gently to the ground. Get back, Teach, said Cohen slowly. I reckon this one's mine. Got another anky? Thanks. The samurai looked at Cohen's sword. It was long, heavy, and had so many notches in it it could have been used as a saw. You'll never do it, he said, with that sword. Never. Cohen blew his nose noisily. You say, he said. Watch this. The handkerchief soared into the air. Cohen gripped his sword. He'd beheaded three upward-staring samurai before the handkerchief started to tumble. Other members of the horde, who tended to think in much the same way as their leader, had accounted for half a dozen more. Got the idea from Caleb, said Cohen, and the message is, either fight or muck about. It's up to you. Have you no honour? screamed Lord Hong. Are you just a ruffian? I'm a barbarian, shouted Cohen, and the honour I got, see, is mine. I didn't steal it off someone else. I had wanted to take you alive, said Lord Hong. However, I see no reason to stick to this policy. He drew his sword. Back, you scum, he screamed. Right back, let the bombardiers come forward. He looked back at Cohen. His face was flushed. His spectacles were askew. Lord Hong had lost his temper. And as is always the case when a dam bursts, it engulfs whole countries. The soldiers pulled back. The horde were, once again, in a widening circle. What's a bombardier? said Boy Willie. Er, uh, I believe it must mean people who fire some sort of projectile, said Mr. Savaloy. The word derives from... Oh, archers, said Boy Willie, and spat. What? said Mad Hamish. He said they're going to use archers, Hamish. <laughs> we never let archers stop us at the Battle of Coombe Valley, tackled the antique barbarian. Boy Willie sighed. That was between dwarfs and trolls, Hamish, hey, he said, and you ain't either. So whose side were you on? What? I said, whose side were you on? I were on the side of being paid money to fight, said Hamish. Beside the race. Rincewind lay on the floor with his hands over his ears. The sound of thunder filled the underground chamber. Blue and purple light shone so brightly that he could see it through his eyelids. Finally, the cacophony subsided. There were still the sounds of the storm outside, but the light had faded to a blue-white glow and the sound into a steady humming. Rincewind risked rolling over and opening his eyes. Hanging from rusted chains in the roof were big glass globes. Each one was the size of a man, and lightning crackled and sizzled inside, stabbing at the glass, seeking a way out. At one time there must have been many more, but dozens of the big globes had fallen down over the years and lay in pieces on the floor. There were still scores up there, swaying gently on their chains as the imprisoned thunderstorms fought for their freedom. The air felt greasy. 
Sparks crawled over the floor and crackled on each angle. Brinswind stood up. His beard streamed out as a mass of individual hairs. The lightning globes shone down on a round lake of, to judge from the ripples, pure quicksilver. In the center was a low, five-sided island. As Rincewind stared, a boat came drifting gently around to his side of the pool, making a little slup-slup noise as it moved through the mercury. It was not a lot larger than a rowing boat, and lying on its tiny deck was a figure in armor. Or, possibly, just the armor. If it was just empty armor, then it was lying in the arms-folded position of a suit of armor that has passed away. Rincewind sidled around the silver lake until he reached a slab of what looked very much like gold, set in the floor in front of a statue. He knew you got inscriptions in tombs, although he was never sure who it was who was supposed to read them. The gods, possibly, although surely they knew everything already. He'd never considered that they'd cluster around and say things like, Gosh, dearly beloved, was he? I never knew that. This one simply said, in pictograms, One Sun Mirror. There wasn't anything about mighty conquests. There was no list of his tremendous achievements. There was nothing down there about wisdom or being the father of his people. There was no explanation. Whoever knows his name, it seemed to say, knows everything. And there was no admitting the possibility that anyone getting this far would not have heard the name of one sun mirror. The statue looked like porcelain. It had been painted quite realistically. One sun mirror seemed an ordinary sort of man. You would not have pointed him out in a crowd as emperor material, but this man with a little round hat and little round shield and little round men on little round ponies had glued together a thousand warring factions into one great empire, often using their own blood to do it. Rincewind looked closer. Of course, it was just an impression, but around the set of the mouth and the look of the eyes there was an expression he'd last seen on the face of Genghis Cohen. It was the expression of someone who was absolutely and totally unafraid of anything. The little boat headed towards the far side of the lake. One of the globes flickered a little and then faded to red. It winked out. Another followed it. He had to get out. There was something else, though. At the foot of the statue, lying as if they'd just been dropped there, were a helmet, a pair of gauntlets, and two heavy-looking boots. Rincewind picked up the helmet. It didn't look very strong, but it did look quite light. Normally he didn't bother with protective clothing, reasoning that the best defense against threatening danger was to be on another continent. But right now the idea of armor had its attractions. He removed his hat, put the helmet on, put down the visor, and then wedged the hat on top of the helmet. There was a flicker in front of his eyes, and Rincewind was staring at the back of his own head. It was a grainy picture, and it was in shades of green rather than proper colors, but it was definitely the back of his own head he was looking at. People had told him what it looked like. He raised the visor and blinked. The pool was still in front of him. He lowered the visor. There he was, about fifty feet away, with his helmet on his head. He waved a hand up and down. The figure in the visor waved a hand up and down. He turned around and faced himself. Yep, that was him. Okay, he thought. A magic helmet. It lets you see yourself a long way away. Great. You can have fun watching yourself fall into holes you can't see because they're right up close. He turned around again, raised the visor, and inspected the gloves. They seemed as light as the helmet, but quite clumsy. You could hold a sword, but not much else. He tried one on. Immediately, with a faint sizzling noise, a row of little pictures lit up on the wide cuff. They showed soldiers. Soldiers digging, soldiers fighting, soldiers climbing. Ah, so... Magic armor. Perfectly normal magic armor. It had never been very popular in Ankh Morpork. Of course it was light, you could make it as thin as cloth, but it tended to lose its magic without warning. Many an ancient lord's last words had been, You can't kill me because I've got magic. Ah! Rincewind looked at the boots, with suspicious recollection of the trouble there had been with the university's prototype Seven League boots. Footwear which tried to make you take steps twenty-one miles long imposed unfortunate groinal strains. They'd got the things off the student just in time, but he'd still had to wear a special device for several months, and eight standing up. All right, but even old magic armor would be useful now. It wasn't as if it weighed much, and the mud of Hung Hung hadn't improved what was left of his own boots. He put his feet into them. He thought, well, so, what's supposed to happen now? 
he straightened up, and behind him, with the sound of seven thousand flower pots smashing together, the lightning still crackling over them, the Red Army came to attention. Hex had grown a bit during the night. Adrian Turnip Seed, who had been on duty to feed the mice and rewind the clockwork and clean out the dead ants, had sworn that he'd done nothing else and that no one had come in. But now, where there had been the big clumsy arrangement of blocks so that the results could be read, was a quill pen in the middle of a network of pulleys and levers. Uh, uh, watch, said Adrian, nervously tapping out a very simple problem. It's come up with this after doing all those spells at supper time. The ants scuttled. The clockwork spun. The springs and levers jerked so sharply that Ponder took a step back. The quill pen wobbled over to an inkwell, dipped, returned to the sheet of paper Adrian had put under the levers, and began to write. It blots a bit, he said in a helpless tone of voice. What's happening? Ponder had been thinking further about this. The latest conclusions hadn't been comforting. Well. We know that books containing magic become a little bit sapient, he began, and we've made a machine for. You mean it's alive? Come on, let's not get all occult about this," said Ponder, trying to sound jovial. "We're wizards, after all." Listen, you know that long problem in Thalmic Fields you wanted me to put in? Yes. Well, it gave me the answer at midnight. Said Adrian, his face pale. Good, yes, good. Except that I didn't actually give it the problem until half past one. Ponder. You're telling me you got the answer before you asked the question. Yes. Why did you ask the question then? I, I thought about it. And I thought maybe I had to. I mean, it couldn't have known what the answer was going to be if I didn't give it the problem, right? Um. Good point. Um, you waited ninety minutes, though. Adrian looked at his pointy boots. I, I, I was hiding in the privy. Well, redo from start could. All right, all right. Going to have something to eat. Are we meddling with things we don't understand, Ponder? Ponder looked up at the gnomic bulk of the machine. It didn't seem threatening, merely other. He thought, meddle first, understand later. You had to meddle a bit before you had anything to try to understand, and the thing was never ever to go back and hide in the lavatory of unreason. You have to try to get your mind around the universe before you can give it a twist. Perhaps we shouldn't have given you a name. We didn't think about that. It was a joke, but we should have remembered that names are important. A thing with a name is a bit more than a thing. Off you go, Adrian," he said firmly. He sat down and carefully typed, "Hello." Things word, the quill wrote plus 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 question mark question mark plus 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 hello plus 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 redo from start plus plus plus. Far above, a butterfly, its wings an undistinguished yellow with black markings, fluttered through an open window. Ponder began the calculations for the transfer between Hung Hung and Ankh Morpork. The butterfly alighted for a moment on the maze of glass pipes. When it rose again, it left behind a very small blob of nectar. Ponder typed carefully far below. A small but significant ant, one of the scurrying thousands, emerged from a break in the tube and spent a few seconds sucking at the sweet liquid before going back to work. After a while, Hex gave an answer. Apart from one small but significant point, it was entirely correct. Rincewind turned around. With an echoing chorus of creaks and groans, the Red Army turned around too, and it was red. It was the same colour. Rincewind realised as the soil. He'd bumped into a few statues in the darkness. He hadn't realised that there were this many. They stretched rank on rank into the distant shadows. Experimentally, he turned around. Behind him, there was another chorus of stampings. After a few false starts, he found that the only way to end up facing them was to take off the boots, turn, and put the boots on again. He lowered the visor for a moment and saw himself lowering the visor for a moment. He stuck up an arm. They stuck out their arms. He jumped up and down. They jumped up and down with a crash that made the globe swing. Lightning sizzled from their boots. He felt a sudden hysterical urge to laugh. He touched his nose. They touched their noses. He made with terrible glee the traditional gesture for the dismissal of demons. 
Seven thousand terracotta middle fingers stabbed towards the ceiling. He tried to calm down. The word his mind had been groping for finally surfaced, and it was golem. There were one or two of them, even in Ark Morpork. You were bound to get them in any area where you had wizards or priests of an experimental turn of mind. They were usually just figures made out of clay and animated with some suitable spell or prayer. They pottered about doing simple odd jobs, but they were not very fashionable these days. The problem was not putting them to work, but stopping them from working. If you set a golem to digging a garden, then forgot about it, you'd come back to find it had planted a row of beans 1,500 miles long. Rincewind looked down at one of the gloves. He cautiously touched the little picture of a fighting soldier. The sound of seven thousand swords being simultaneously unsheathed was like the tearing of a thick sheet of steel. Seven thousand points were pointed right at Rincewind. He took a step back. So did the army. He was in a place with thousands of artificial soldiers wearing swords. The fact that he appeared to have control of them was no great comfort. He theoretically had control of Rincewind for the whole of his life, and look what happened to him. He looked at the little pictures again. One of them showed a soldier with two heads. When he touched it, the army turned about smartly. Ah, now to get out of here. The horde watched the bustle among Lord Hong's men. Objects were being dragged to the front line. They don't look like archers to me, said Boy Willie. Those things are barking dogs, said Cohen. I should know. Seen them before. They're like a barrel full of fireworks, and when the fireworks are lit, a big stone comes rushing out the other end. Why? Well, would you hang around if someone had just lit a firework by your arse? Here, teach. He said arse, complained Truckle. Look, on my bit of paper here, it says you mustn't say arse. We've got shields, haven't we? said Mr. Savaloy. I'm sure if we keep close together and put the shields over our heads, we'll be as right as rain. The stone's about a foot across and going very fast, and it's red hot. Not shields, then. No, said Cohen. Truckle, you push Hamish. We won't get fifty yards, Genghis, said Caleb. Better fifty yards now than six feet in a minute, yes, said Cohen. Bravo, said Mr. Savaloy. What? said Mad Hamish. Lord Hong watched them. He saw the horde hang their shields around the wheelchair to form a crude travelling wall, and saw the wheels begin to turn. He raised his sword. Fire! Still tamping the charges, O oh Lord. I said fire! Got to prime the dogs, O oh Lord. The bombardiers worked feverishly, spurred on less by terror of Lord Hong than by the onrushing horde. Mr. Savaloy's hair streamed in the wind. He bounded through the dust, waving his sword and screaming. He'd never been so happy in all his life. So this was the secret at the heart of it all, to look death right in the face and charge. It made everything so utterly simple. Lord Hong threw down his helmet. Fire, you wretched peasants, you... Scum of the earth, why must I ask twice? Give me that torch! He pushed the bombardier aside, crouched down beside a dog, heaved on it so that the barrel was pointing at the oncoming Cohen, lifted the torch. The earth heaved, the dog reared and rolled sideways. A round, red head, smiling faintly, rose out of the ground. There were screams in the ranks as the soldiers looked down at the moving dirt under their boots, tried to run on a surface that was just shifting soil, and disappeared in the rising cloud of dust. The ground caved in. Then it caved out again as stricken soldiers climbed up one another to escape, because rising gently through the turmoil was the soil in human shape. The horde skidded to a halt. What are they, trolls? said Cohen. Ten of the figures were visible now, industriously digging at the air. Then they stopped. One of them turned its gently smiling head this way and that. A sergeant must have screamed a handful of archers into line, because a few arrows shattered on the terracotta armour with absolutely no effect. Other red warriors were climbing up behind the former diggers. They collided with them with a sound of crockery. Then, as one man, or troll, or demon, they drew their swords, turned round, and headed towards Lord Hong's army. 
A few soldiers tried to fight them simply because there was too great a crowd behind them to run away. They died. It wasn't that the Red Guards were good fighters. They were very mechanical, each one performing the same thrust, parry, slash, regardless of what their opponent was doing. But they were simply unstoppable. If their opponent escaped one of the blows but didn't get out of the way, then he was just trodden on, and by the looks of things, the warriors were extremely heavy. And it was the way the things smiled all the time that added to the terror. Well now, there's a thing, Cohen said, feeling for his tobacco pouch. Never seen trolls fight like that, said Truckle. Rank after rank was walking up out of the hole, stabbing happily at the air. The front row were moving in a cloud of dust and screams. It is hard for a big army to do anything quickly, and divisions trying to move forward to see what the trouble was were getting in the way of fleeing individuals seeking a hole to hide in and permanent civilian status. Gongs were banging and men were trying to shout orders, but no one knew what the gongs were meant to mean or how the orders should be obeyed because there didn't seem to be enough time. Cohen finished rolling his cigarette and struck a match on his chin. Right, he said to the world in general, let's get that bloody hong. The clouds overhead were less fearsome now. There was less lightning, but there was still a lot of them, greeny black, heavy with rain. But this is amazing said Mr. Savaloy. A few drops hit the ground, leaving wide craters in the dirt. Yeah, right, said Cohen. A most strange phenomenon. Warriors rising out of the ground. The craters joined up. It felt as though the drops were joining up as well. The rain began to pour down. Dunno, said Cohen, watching a ragged platoon flee past. Never been here before. Perhaps this happens a lot. I mean, it's just like that myth about the man who sewed dragon's teeth and terrible fighting skeletons came up. I don't believe that, said Caleb, as they jogged after Cohen. Why not? If you sew dragon's teeth, you should get dragons, not fighting skeletons. What did it say on the packet? I don't know. The myth never said anything about them coming in a packet. Should have said, comes up dragons on the packet. You can't believe myths, said Cohen. I should know. Right, there he is, he added, pointing to a distant horseman. The whole plain was in turmoil now. The Red Warriors were only the start. The alliance of the five warlords was glass fragile in any case, and panicky flight was instantly interpreted as a sneak attack. No one paid any attention to the horde. They didn't have any coloured pennants or gongs. They weren't traditional enemies. And besides, the soil was now mud and the mud flew, and everyone from the waist down was the same colour, and this was rising. "'What are we doing, Genghis?' said Mr. Savaloy. "'We are heading back for the palace.' "'Why?' "'Cause that's where Hong's gone.' "'But there's this uh, astonishing—' "'Look, Teach, I've seen walking trees and spider gods and big green things with teeth,' said Cohen. "'It's no good going round saying, astonishing, all the time. Ain't that so, Truckle?' "'Right.' Do you know, when I went after the five-headed vampire goat over in Scund, they said I shouldn't on account of it being an endangered species. I said, yes, that was down to me. Were they grateful? <laughs> said Caleb. Should have thanked you, giving them all those endangered species to worry about. Turn around and go home right now, soldier boy. A group of soldiers, fighting to get away from the Red Warriors, skidded in the mud, started in terror at the horde, and headed off in a new direction. Truckle stopped for breath, rain streaming off his beard. I can't be having with this running, though, he said. Not and push Hamish's wheelchair in all this mud. Let's have a breather. What? Stop him for a breather, said Cohen. My gods, I never thought I'd see the day. A hero having a rest. Did Volton the Indestructible have a bit of a rest? He's having one now. He's dead, Genghis, said Caleb. Cohen hesitated. What? Oh, Volten, didn't you know, and the immortal Jenkins? Jenkins isn't dead. I saw him only last year. But he's dead now. All the heroes are dead except us, and I ain't too sure about me, too. Cohen splashed forward and snatched Caleb upright by his shirt. What about Harun? He can't be dead. He's our fire age. Last I heard, he got a job, sergeant of the guard somewhere. Sergeant of the Guard, said Cohen. 
What, for pay? Yep. But, what, like, for pay? He told me he might make captain next year. He said, he said it's a job with a pension. Cohen released his grip. There's not many of us now, Cohen, said Truckle. Cohen spun round. All right, but there's never been many of us, and I ain't dying. Not if it means the world's taken over by bastards like Hong who don't know what a chieftain is. Scum. That's what he called his soldiers, scum. It's like that bloody civilised game you showed us, Teach. Cheers. Right. The prawns are just there to be slaughtered by the other side, while the king just hangs around at the back. Yeah, but the other side's you, Cohen. Right, right. Well, yes, that's fine when I'm the enemy, but I don't shove men in front of me to get killed instead of me, and I never use bows and then dog things. When I kill someone, it's up close and personal. Armies? Bloody tactics? There's only one way to fight, and that's everyone charging all at once, waving their swords and shouting. Now, on your feet, and let's get after him. It's been a long morning, Genghis, said Boy Willie. Don't give me that. I could do with the lavatory. It's all this rain. Let's get Hong first. If he's hiding in the privy, that's fine by me. They reached the city gates. They had been shut. Hundreds of people, citizens as well as guards, watched them from the walls. Cohen waved a finger at them. Now, I ain't going to say this twice, he said. I'm coming in, OK? It can be the easy way, or it can be the hard way. Impassive faces looked down at the skinny old man, and up at the plain, where the armies of the warlords fought one another, and in terror, the terracotta warriors. Down, up. Down, up. Right, said Cohen. Don't say afterwards I didn't warn you. He raised his sword and prepared to charge. Wait, said Mr. Savaloy. Listen. There was a shouting behind the walls, and some confused orders, and then more shouting, and then a couple of screams. The gates swung open, pulled by dozens of citizens. Cohen lowered his sword. Ah, he said, they've seen reason, have they? Wheezing a little, the horde limped through the gates. The crowd watched them in silence. Several guards lay dead. Rather more had removed their helmets and decided to opt for a bright new future in Civvy Street, where you were less likely to get beaten to death by an angry mob. Every face watched Cohen, turning to follow him as flowers follow the sun. He ignored them. Crowdy the Strong, he said to Caleb. Dead. Can't be. He was a picture of Elf when I saw him a couple of months ago. Going on a new quest and everything. Dead. What happened? You know the terrible man-eating sloth of Klopp? The one they say guards the giant ruby of the mad snake god? The very same. Well, it was. The crowd parted to let the horde through. One or two people tried a cheer, but were shushed into silence. It was a silence that Mr. Savaloy had only heard before in the most devout of temples. The only sound the horde had ever heard in temples was people shouting, Infidel, he has stolen the jeweled eye of, your wife is a big hippo. There was a whispering, though, growing out of that watchful silence like bubbles in a pot of water on a hot fire. It went like this. The Red Army. The Red Army. How about Organdy Sloggo? Still going strong down in her wonderland, last I heard. Dead. Metal poisoning. How? Three swords through the stomach. The Red Army. Slasher Mungo? Presumed dead in scund. Presumed? Well, they only found his head. The Red Army. The horde approached the inner gates of the Forbidden City. The crowd followed them at a distance. These gates were shut too. A couple of heavy-set guards were standing in front of them. They wore the expressions of men who'd been told to guard the gates and were going to guard the gates come what may. The military depends on people who will guard gates or bridges or passes come what may, and there are often heroic poems written in their honour, invariably posthumously. Gosbar the Wake? Died in bed, I heard. No, Gosbar. Everyone's got to sleep sometime. That's not the only thing they've got to do, mister, said Boy Willie. I really need the what's name Well, does the wall? Not with everyone watching. They ain't, ain't civilised. Cohen strode up to the guards. 
I'm not mucking about, he said. OK? Would you rather die than betray your emperor? The guards stared ahead. Right. Fair enough. Cohen drew his sword. A thought seemed to strike him. Nurka, he said. Big Nurka. Tough as old boots, him. Fishbone, said Caleb. Nurka? He once killed six trolls with a... Choked on a fishbone in his gruel. I thought you knew. Sorry. Cohen stared at him, and then at his sword, and then at the guards. For a moment there was silence, broken only by the sound of the rain. You know, lads, he said in a voice so suddenly full of weariness that Mr. Savaloy felt a pit opening up here at the moment of triumph. I was going to chop your heads off, but what's the point, eh? I mean, when you get right down to it, why bother? What sort of difference does it make? The guards still stared straight ahead, but their eyes were widening. Mr. Savaloy turned. You'll end up dead anyway, sooner or later, Cohen went on. Well, that's about it. You live your life the best way you can, and then it don't actually matter because you're dead. Um, Cohen, said Mr. Savaloy, I mean, look at me. Been chopping heads off my whole life, and what have I got to show for it? Cohen! The guards weren't just staring now. Their faces were dragging themselves into very creditable grimaces of fear. Cohen! Yeah, what? I think you should look round, Cohen. Cohen turned. Half a dozen red warriors were advancing up the street. The crowd had pulled right back and were watching in silent terror. Then a voice shouted, Extended duration to the Red Army! Cries rose up here and there in the crowd. A young woman raised her hand in a clenched fist. Advance necessarily with the people while retaining due regard for traditions. Others joined her. Deserved correction to enemies. I've lost Mr. Bunny. The red giants clonked to a halt. Look at them, said Mr. Savaloy. They're not trolls. They move like some kind of engine. Doesn't that interest you? No, said Cohen vacantly. Abstract thinking is not a major aspect of the barbarian mental process. Now, where was I? He sighed. Oh, yes, you too. You'd rather die than betray your emperor, would you? The two men were rigid with fear now. Cohen raised his sword. Mr. Savaloy took a deep breath, grabbed Cohen's sword arm, and shouted, Then open the gates and let him through. There was a moment of utter silence. Mr. Savaloy nudged Cohen. Go on, he hissed. Act like an emperor. What? You mean giggle and have people tortured? That sort of thing. Blow that. No. Act like an emperor ought to act. Cohen glared at Savaloy. Then he turned to the guards. Well done, he said. Your loyalty does you... What's the name? Uh, credit. Keep on like this, and I can see it's promotion for both of you. Now, let us all go inside, or I will have my flowerpot men chop off your feet, so you'll have to kneel in the gutter while you're looking for your head. The men looked at one another, threw down their swords, and tried to kowtow. And you can bloody well get up too, said Cohen, in a slightly nicer tone of voice. Mr. Savaloy? Yes? I'm emperor now, am I? The... Earth soldiers seem to be on our side. The people think you've won. We're all alive. I'd say we've won, yes. If I'm emperor, I can tell everyone what to do, right? Oh, indeed. Properly, you know, scrolls and stuff. Buggers in uniform, blowing trumpets and saying, This is what he wants you to do. Ah, you, you want to make a proclamation. Yeah, no more of this bloody kowtowing. It makes me squirm. No kowtowing by anyone to anyone, all right? If anyone sees me, they can salute or maybe give me some money. But none of this banging your head on the ground stuff. It gives me the willies. Now, dress up that in proper writing. Right away. And hang on, haven't finished yet. Cohen bit his lip in unaccustomed cogitation as the red warriors lurched to a stop. Yeah. 
you can add that I'm letting all prisoners go free unless they've done something really bad, like attempted poisoning for a start. You can work out the details. All torturers have to have their heads cut off, and every peasant can have a free pig, something like that. I'll leave you to put in all the proper curly bits about by order and stuff. Cohen looks down at the guards. Get up, I said. I swear the next bastard that kisses the ground in front of me is going to get kicked in the antique chicken coops. OK, now, open the gates. The crowd cheered. As the horde stepped inside the Forbidden City, they followed in a sort of cross between a revolutionary charge and a respectful walk. The Red Warriors stood outside. One of them raised a terracotta foot, which groaned a little, and walked towards the wall until it bumped into it. The warrior staggered drunkenly for a while and then managed to get within a yard or two of the wall without colliding with it. It raised a finger and wrote shakily in red dust that turned to a kind of paint on the wet plaster. Help, help, it's me. I'm out here on the plain. Help, I can't get this bloody armour off. The crowd surged along behind Cohen, shouting and singing. If he'd had a surfboard, he could have ridden on it. The rain drummed heavily on the roof and poured into the courtyards. Why are they all so excited, he said. They think you're going to sack the palace, said Mr. Savaloy. They've heard about barbarians, you see. They want some of it. Anyway, they like the idea about the pig. Hey, you, shouted Cohen to a boy struggling past under the weight of a huge vase. Get your thieving paws off my stuff. That's valuable, that is. It's, um, it's, uh... It's a Sang dynasty, said Mr. Savaloy. That's right, said the vase. That's a Sang dynasty, that is. Put it back. And you lot back there, he turned and waved his sword. Get those shoes off. You're scratching the floor. Look at the state of it already. You never bothered about the floor yesterday, Truckle grumbled. "'Twere my floor, then.' "'Yes, it was,' said Mr. Savaloy. "'Not properly,' said Cohen. "'Right of conquest. That's the thing. "'Blood. People understand blood. "'You just walk in and take over and no one takes it seriously. "'But seas of blood. Everyone understands that.' "'Mountains of skulls,' said Truckle approvingly. "'Look at his street,' said Cohen. "'Whenever you... "'Hey, you, the man with the hat, that's my... Inlaid mahogany shibo yangkong sand table, murmured Mr. Savaloy. Yeah, so put it back, you hear? Yes, whenever you comes across a king where everyone says, Ooh, he was a good king, all right. You can bet your sandals he was a great big bearded bastard who broke heads a lot and laughed about it, eh? But some king who just passed decent little laws and read books and tried to look intelligent. Oh, they say, oh, he was all right, a bit wet. Not what I call a proper king. That's people for you. Mr. Savaloy sighed. Cohen grinned at him and slapped him on the back so hard he stumbled into two women trying to carry off a bronze statue of Lee Tin Weedle. Can't quite face it, Teach, can you? Can't get your mind round it. Don't worry about it. Basically, you ain't a barbarian. Put that damn statue back, missus, or you'll feel the flat of my sword, so you will. But I thought we could do it without anyone getting hurt, by, by using our brains. Can't. History don't work like that. Blood first, then brains. Mountains of skulls, said Truckle. There's got to be a better way than fighting, said Mr. Savaloy. Yeah, lots of them, only none of them work. Caleb, take those fine bong jade miniatures muttered Mr. Savaloy. Yeah, take them off that fella. He's got one under his hat. Another set of carved doors was swung open. This room was already crowded, but the people shuffled backwards as the doors parted and tried to look keen while avoiding catching Cohen's eye. As they pulled away, they left six beneficent winds standing all alone. The court had become very good at this manoeuvre. Mountains of skulls, said Truckle, not a man to let go in a hurry. Uh, we saw the Red Army rise out of the ground, uh, just as the legend foretold. Truly, you are the pre-incarnation of one sun mirror. The little taxman had the decency to look embarrassed. As speeches went, it was on a dramatic level with the one that traditionally began, 
As you know, your father, the king, besides, he'd never believed in legends up till now. Not even the one about the peasant who every year filed a scrupulously honest tax return. Yeah, right, said Cohen. He strode to the throne and stuck his sword in the floor where it vibrated. Some of you are going to get your heads cut off for your own good, he said. But I haven't decided who yet. And someone show Boy Willie where the privy is. No need, said Boy Willie. Not after them big red statues turned up behind me so sudden. Mountains of sc... Chuckle began. Don't know about mountains, said Cohen. And where, said Six Beneficent Winds tremulously, is the Great Wizard? Great Wizard, said Cohen. Yes, the Great Wizard who summoned the Red Army from the Earth said the tax man. Don't know anything about him, said Cohen. The crowd staggered forward as more people piled into the room. They're coming. A terracotta warrior clomped its way into the room, its face still wearing a very faint smile. It stopped, rocking a little, while water dripped off it. People had crouched back in terror, except the horde, Mr. Savaloy noticed. Faced with unknown yet terrible dangers, the horde were either angry or puzzled. Then he cheered up. They weren't better, just different. They're all right facing huge, terrible creatures, he told himself, but ask them to go down the street and buy a bag of rice, and they go all to pieces. What's my move now, Teach? Cohen whispered. Well, your emperor, said Mr. Savaloy, I think you talk to it. OK. Cohen stood up and nodded cheerfully at the terracotta giant. Morning, he said. Nice bit of work out there. You and the rest of your lads can have the day off to plant geraniums in yourselves or whatever you do. Uh, you got a number one giant I ought to speak to? The terracotta warrior creaked as it raised one finger. Then it pressed two fingers against one forearm, then raised a finger again. Everyone in the crowd started talking at once. The giant tugged one vestigial ear with two fingers. What can this mean? said six beneficent winds. I find this a little hard to credit, said Mr. Savaloy, but it is an ancient method of communication used in the land of blood-sucking vampire ghosts. You can understand it. Oh, yes, I think so. You have to try and guess the word or phrase. It's trying to tell us, um, one word, uh, two syllables. First syllable sounds like... The giant cupped one hand and made circular handle-turning motions with the other alongside it. Turning, said Mr. Savaloy. Winding, reeling, uh, revolve, grind, grind, uh, chop, mince. The giant tapped its nose hurriedly and did a very heavy, noisy dance, bits of terracotta armour clanking. Sounds like mince, said Mr. Savaloy. First syllable sounds like mince. Uh, a ragged figure pushed its way through the crowd. It wore glasses, one lens of which was cracked. Uh, it said, I've got an idea about that. Lord Fang and some of his more trusted warriors had clustered on the side of the hills. A good general always knows when to leave the battlefield, and as far as Lord Fang was concerned, it was when he saw the enemy coming towards him. The men were shaken. They hadn't tried to face the Red Army. Those who had were dead. We regroup, panted Lord Fang, and then we'll wait until nightfall, and... What's that? There was a rhythmic noise coming from the bushes further up the slope, where sliding earth had left another bush-filled ravine. Sounds like a carpenter, my lord, said one of the soldiers. Up here, in the middle of a war, go and see what it is. The man scrambled away. After a while, there was a pause in the sawing noise. Then it started again. Lord Fang had been trying to work out a fresh battle plan according to the nine useful principles. He threw down his map. Why is that still going on? Where is Captain Nong? Hasn't come back, my lord. Then go and see what happened to him. Lord Fang tried to remember if the great military sage had ever had anything to say about fighting giant invulnerable statues. He... The sawing paused. Then it was replaced by the sound of hammering. Lord Fang looked around. 
Can I have an order obeyed around here? he bellowed. He picked up his sword and scrambled up the muddy slope. The bushes parted ahead of him. There was a clearing. There was a rushing shape. On hundreds of little lit, there was a snap. The rain was coming down so fast that the drops were having to queue. The red earth was hundreds of feet deep in places. It produced two or three crops a year. It was rich. It was fecund. It was, when wet, extremely sticky. The surviving armies had squelched from the field of battle, as red from head to toe as the terracotta men. Not counting those merely trodden on, the Red Army had not in fact killed very many people. Terror had done most of their work. Rather more soldiers had been killed in the brief inter-army battles, and in the scramble to escape, by their own sides. Friendly stab, as it is formerly known. The Terracotta Army had the field to itself. It was celebrating victory in various ways. Many guards were walking around in circles, wading through the clinging mud as if it was so much dirty air. A number of them were digging a trench, the sides of which were washing in on them in the thundering rain. A few were trying to climb the walls that weren't there. Several, possibly as a result of the exertion following centuries of zero maintenance, had spontaneously exploded in a shower of blue sparks, the red-hot clay shrapnel being a major factor in the opposition's death count. And all the time, the rain fell, a solid curtain of water. It didn't look natural. It was as though the sea had decided to reclaim the land by airdrop. Rincewind shut his eyes. Mud covered the armour. He couldn't make out the pictures any more, and that was something of a relief because he was pretty certain he was messing things up. You could see what any warrior was seeing, at least presumably you could, if you knew what some of the odder pictures actually did and how to press them in the right order. Rincewind didn't, and in any case, whoever had made the magic armour hadn't assumed it would be used in knee-deep mud during a vertical river. Every now and then it sizzled. One of the boots was getting hot. It had started out so well, but there had been what he was coming to think of as the rincewind factor. Probably some other wizard would have marched the army out and wouldn't have been rained on, and even now would be parading through the streets of Hung Hung while people threw flowers and said, My word, there's a great wizard and no mistake. Some other wizard wouldn't have pressed the wrong picture and started the things digging. He realized he was wallowing in self-pity. Rather more pertinently, he was also wallowing in mud. And he was sinking. Trying to pull a foot out was no use. It didn't work, and the other foot only went deeper and got hotter. Lightning struck the ground nearby. He heard it sizzle, saw the steam, felt the tingle of electricity, and tasted the taste of burning tin. Another bolt hit a warrior. Its torso exploded, raining a sticky black tar. The legs kept going for a few steps and then stopped. Water poured past him, thick and red now that the river hung was overflowing, and the mud continued to suck on his feet like a hollow tooth. Something swirled past on the muddy water. It looked like a scrap of paper. Rincewind hesitated, then reached out awkwardly with a gloved hand and scooped it up. It was, as he'd expected, a butterfly. Thank you very much, he said bitterly. The water drained through his fingers. He half closed his hand and then sighed, and as gently as he could, manoeuvred the creature onto a finger. Its wings hung damply. He shielded it with his other hand and blew on its wings a few times. Go on, push off. The butterfly turned. Its multifaceted eyes glinted green for a moment, and then it flapped its wings experimentally. It stopped raining. It started to snow. But only where Rincewind was. Oh, yes, said Rincewind. Yes, indeed. Oh, thank you so very much. Life was, he had heard, like a bird which flies out of the darkness and across a crowded hall, and then through another window into an endless night again. In Rincewind's case, it had managed to do something incontinent in his dinner. The snow stopped. The clouds pulled back from the dome of the sky with astonishing speed, letting in hot sunlight which almost immediately made the mud steam. There you are. We've been looking everywhere. Rincewind tried to turn, but the mud made that impossible. There was a wooden thump as of a plank being laid down on wet ooze. Snow on his head? In bright sunshine, I said to myself. That's him all right. There was the thump of another plank. 
A small avalanche slid off the helmet and slid down Rincewind's neck. Another thump and a plank squelched into the mud beside him. It's me, Two Flower. You all right, old friend? I think my foot is being cooked, but apart from that, I'm as happy as anything. I knew it would be you doing the charades, said Two Flower, sticking his hands under the wizard's shoulders and hauling. You got the wind syllable, said Rincewind. That was very hard to do by remote control. Oh, none of us got that, said Two Flower. But when it did, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, I'm going to die. Everyone got that first go. Very inventive. Um, you seem to be stuck. I think it's the magic boots. Can't you wriggle them off? The mud dries like, well, like terracotta in the sun. Someone can come along and dig them out afterwards. Rincewind tried to move his feet. There were some sub mud bubblings, and he felt his feet come free with a muffled slurping noise. Finally, with considerable effort, he was sitting on the plank. Sorry about the warriors, he said. It looked so simple when I started out, and then I got confused with all the pictures, and it was impossible to stop some of them doing things. But it was a famous victory, said Two Flower. Was it? Mr. Cohen's been made emperor. He has. Well, not made. I mean, no one made him. He just came along and took it. And everyone says he's the pre-incarnation of the first emperor. And he says if you want to be the great wizard, that's fine by him. Sorry, you lost me there. You led the Red Army, didn't you? You made them rise up in the empire's hour of need. Well, I wouldn't exactly say that I. So the emperor wants to reward you. Isn't that nice? How do you mean reward? Said Rincewind with deep suspicion. Not sure, really. Actually, what he said was, Two Flower's eyes glazed as he tried to recall. He said, "You go and find Rincewind and say he might be a bit of a pilot, but at least he's straight, so he can be chief wizard of the empire or whatever he wants to call it. 'Cause I don't trust you, foreign." Two Flower's squinted upwards as he tried to remember Cohen's precise words: "House of auspicious aspect, scent of pine trees, buggers." The words trickled into Rincewind's ear, slid up into his brain, and started to bang on the walls. Chief Wizard, he said. That's what he said. Well, actually, what he said was he wanted you to be a blob of swallows' vomit, but that was because he used the low, sad tone rather than the high, questioning one. He definitely meant wizard. Of the whole empire, Rincewind stood up. Something very bad is about to happen. He said flatly. The sky was quite blue now. A few citizens had ventured onto the battlefield to tend the wounded and retrieve the dead. Terracotta warriors stood at various angles, motionless as rocks. Any minute now, said Rincewind. Shouldn't we get back? Probably a meteorite strike, said Rincewind. Two Flower looked up at the peaceful sky. You know me, said Rincewind. Just when I'm getting a grip on something, fate comes along and jumps on my fingers. I don't see any meteorites," said Two Flower. "How long do we wait?" "It'll be something else then," said Rincewind. "Someone will come leaping out, or there'll be an earthquake, or something." "If you insist," said Two Flower politely. "And、um, do you want to wait for something horrible here, or would you like to go back to the palace and have a bath and change your clothes and then see what happens?" Rincewind conceded that he might as well await a dreadful fate in comfort. There's going to be a feast," said Two Flower. "The Emperor says he's going to teach everyone how to quaff." They made their way plank by plank towards the city. You know, I swear you never told me that you were married. Oh, I'm sure I did. I was.、Um, I was sorry to hear that your wife.、Um, Things happen in war. I have two dutiful daughters. Rincewind opened his mouth to say something, but Two Flower's bright, brittle smile froze the words in his throat. They worked without speaking, picking up the planks behind them and extending the walkway in front. Looking on the bright side, said Two Flower, breaking the silence, the Emperor said you could start your own university if you want. No, no, no! Someone hit me with an iron bar, please. He said he's well in favour of education, provided no one makes him have one. He's been making proclamations like mad. The eunuchs have threatened to go on strike. Rincewind's plank dropped onto the mud. What is it that eunuchs do? He said. That they stop doing when they go on strike. Serve food, make the beds, things like that. Oh. 
They run the Forbidden City, really, but the Emperor talks them round to his point of view. Really? He said if they didn't get cracking right now, he'd cut off everything else. Hmm. I think the ground's firm enough now. His own university. That'd make him Arch-Chancellor. Rinkswind the Arch-Chancellor pictured himself visiting Unseen University. He could have a hat with a really big point. He'd be able to be rude to everyone. He'd... He tried to stop himself from thinking like that. It'd all go wrong. Of course, said Two Flower, it might be that the bad things have already happened to you. Have you considered that? Perhaps you'll do something nice? Oh, don't give me any of that karma stuff, said Rincewind. The Wheel of Fortune has lost a few spokes where I'm concerned. It's worth considering, though, said Two Flower. What, that the rest of my life will be peaceful and enjoyable? Sorry, no. You wait. When my back's turned... And bang. Two Flower looked around with some interest. I don't know why you think your life has been so bad, he said. We had a lot of fun when we were younger. Hey, do you remember the time when we went over the edge of the world? Often, said Rincewind, usually around 3 a.m. And that time we went on a dragon and it disappeared in midair. You know, said Rincewind, sometimes a whole hour will go by when I don't remember that. And that time we were attacked by those people who wanted to kill us. Which of those 149 occasions are you referring to? Character building, that sort of thing, said Two Flower happily. Made me what I am today. Oh, yes, said Rincewind. It was no effort talking to Two Flower. The little man's trusting nature had no concept of sarcasm and a keen ability not to hear things that might upset him. Yes, I can definitely say it was that sort of thing made me what I am today, too. They stepped inside the city. The streets were practically empty. Most people had flocked to the huge square in front of the palace. New emperors tended towards displays of generosity. Besides, the news had got around that this one was different and was giving away free pigs. I heard him talking about sending envoys to Ankh Morpork, said Two Flower, as they dripped up the street. I expect there's going to be a bit of fuss about that. Was that man disembowel myself honourably present at the time? said Rincewind. Yes, as a matter of fact. When you visited Aunt Morpork, did you ever meet a man called Dibbler? Oh, yes. If those two ever shake hands, I think there might be some sort of explosion. But you could go back, I'm sure, said Two Flower. I mean, your new university will need all sorts of things, and, well, I seem to recall that people in Ark Moorpork were very keen on gold. Rincewind gritted his teeth. The image wouldn't go away. Of Arch-Chancellor Rincewind buying the Tower of Art and getting them to number all the stones and send it back to Hung Hung. Of Arch-Chancellor Rincewind hiring the faculty as college porters. Of Arch-Chancellor Rincewind... No! Pardon? Don't encourage me to think like that. The moment I think that it's going to be worthwhile, something dreadful will happen. There was a movement behind him, and a knife suddenly pressed against his throat. The great blob of swallows vomit, said a voice by his ear. There, said Rincewind. You see? Run away. Don't stand there, you bloody idiot. Run. Two flowers stared for a moment, and then turned and scampered away. Let him go, said the voice. He doesn't matter. Hands pulled him into the alley. He had a vague impression of armour and mud. His captors were skilled in the way of dragging a prisoner so that he had no chance to get a foothold anywhere. Then he was flung onto the cobbles. It does not look so great to me, said an imperious voice. Look up, great wizard. There was some nervous laughter from the soldiers. You fools! raged Lord Hong. He's just a man. Look at him. Does he look so powerful? He is just a man who has found some old trickery. And we will find out how great he is without his arms and legs. Oh, said Rincewind. Lord Hong leaned down. There was mud on his face and a wild glint in his eyes. We shall see what your barbarian emperor can do then, won't we? He indicated the sullen group of mud-encrusted soldiers. You know, they half believe you really are a great wizard. That's superstition, I'm afraid. Very useful most of the time. Damn inconvenient on occasion. 
But when we march you into the square and show them how great you really are, I think your barbarian will not have so very long left. What are these? He snatched the gloves off Rincewind's hands. Toys, he said. Made things. The Red Army are just machines like mills and pumps. There's no magic there. He tossed them aside and nodded at one of the guards. And now, said Lord Hong, let us go to the Imperial Square. How'd you like to be Governor of Bang Bang Duke and all the islands around there, said Cohen, as the horde poured over a map of the Empire. You like the seaside, Hamish? What? The doors of the throne room were flung open. Two flowers scuttled in, trailed by one big river. <sighs> Lord Hong's got Rincewind. He's going to kill him. Cohen looked up. He can wizard himself out of it, can't he? No, he hasn't got the Red Army anymore. <sighs> He's going to kill him. You've got to do something. Oh, well, you know how it is with wizards, said Truckle. There's too many of them as it is. No. Cohen picked up his sword and sighed. Come on, he said. But Cohen... I said, come on, we ain't like Hong. Rincewind's a weasel, but he's our weasel. So you're coming, or what? Lord Hong and his group of soldiers had almost reached the bottom of the wide steps to the palace when the horde emerged. The crowd surrounded them, held back by the soldiers. Lord Hong held Rincewind tightly, a knife at his throat. Ah, Emperor, he said in Ankh-Morporkian. We meet again. Check, I think. What's he mean? Cohen whispered. He thinks he has you cornered, said Mr. Savaloy. How's he know I won't just let the wizard die? Psychology of the individual, I'm afraid. It doesn't make any sense, Cohen shouted. If you kill him, you'll be dead yourself in seconds. I shall see to it personally. And dead, no, said Lord Hong. When you're... Great wizard is dead. When people see how easily he dies, how long will you be emperor? You won by trickery. What are your terms? said Mr. Savaloy. There are none. You can give me nothing I cannot take myself. Lord Hong grabbed Rincewind's hat from one of the guards and rammed it onto Rincewind's head. This is yours, he hissed. Wizard, ha, you can't even spell. Well, wizard, aren't you going to say something? Oh, no. Lord Hong smiled. Ah, that's better, he said. Oh, no. Very good. Oh. Lord Hong blinked. For a moment, the figure in front of him appeared to stretch to twice its height and then have its feet snap under its chin. And then it disappeared with a small thunderclap. There was a silence in the square, except for the sound of several thousand people being astonished. Lord Hong waved his hand vaguely in the air. Lord Hong? There was a short man behind him, covered in grime and mud. He wore a pair of spectacles, one lens of which was cracked. Lord Hong hardly glanced at him. He prodded the air again, unwilling to believe his own senses. Excuse me, Lord Hong, said the apparition, but do you by any chance remember Bess Pelagic? About six years ago, I think you were quarrelling with Lord Tang. There was something of a skirmish, a few streets destroyed, nothing very major. Lord Hong blinked. How dare you address me, he managed. It doesn't really matter, said Two Flower, but it's just that I'd have liked to have remembered. I got quite angry about it. Um... I, 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 I want to fight you. You want to fight me? Do you know who you are talking to? Have you any idea? Um, yes. Oh, yes. Lord Hong's attention finally focused. It had not been a good day. You foolish, stupid little man. You don't even have a sword. Oi, four eyes. They both turned. Cohen threw his sword. Two Flower caught it clumsily and was almost knocked over by the weight. Why did you do that? said Mr. Savaloy. Man wants to be a hero, that's fine by me.
said Cohen. He'll be slaughtered. Might do, might do, might do. He might do that, certainly, Cohen conceded. That's not up to me. Father! Lotus Blossom grabbed Two Flower's arms. He will kill you. Come away. No. Butterfly took her father's other arm. No good purpose will be served, she said. Come on, we can find a better time. He killed your mother, said Two Flower flatly. His soldiers did. That makes it worse. He didn't even know. Please, get back, both of you. Look, father. If you don't both do what you're told, I shall get angry. Lord Hong drew his long sword. The blade gleamed. Do you know anything about fighting, clerk? No, not really, said Two Flower. But the important thing is that somebody should stand up to you, whatever happens to them afterwards. The Horde were watching with considerable interest. Hardened as they were, they had a soft spot for pointless bravery. Yes, said Lord Hong, looking around at the silent crowd. Let everyone see what happens. He raised his sword. The air crackled. The barking dog dropped onto the flagstones in front of him. It was very hot. Its string was alight. There was a brief sizzle. Then the world went white. After some time, Two Flower picked himself up. He seemed to be the first one upright. Those people who hadn't flung themselves to the ground had fled. All that remained of Lord Hong was one shoe, which was smouldering, but there was a smoking trail all the way up the steps behind it. Staggering a little, Two Flower followed the trail. A wheelchair was on its side, one wheel spinning. He peered over it. You all right, Mr. Hamish? What? Good. The rest of the horde were crouched in a circle at the top of the steps. Smoke billowed around them. In its continuing passage, the ball had set fire to part of the palace. Can you hear me teach? Cohen was saying. Course he can't hear you. How can he hear you looking like that? said Truckle. He could still be alive, said Cohen defiantly. He is dead, Cohen. Really, really dead. Alive people have more body. But you're all alive, said Two Flower. I saw it bark straight at you. We got out the way, said Boy Willie. We are good at getting out the way. Poor old Teach. Didn't have our experience of not dying, said Caleb. Cohen stood up. Where's Hong? he said grimly. I'm gonna... He's dead too, Mr. Cohen, said Two Flower. Cohen nodded as if this was all perfectly normal. We owe it to old Teach, he said. He was a good sort, Truckle conceded. Funny ideas about swearing, mind you. He had brains. He cared about stuff. And he might not have lived like a barbarian, but he's bloody well going to be buried like one, all right? In a long ship set on fire, suggested Boy Willie. My word, said Mr. Savaloy. In a big pit on top of the bodies of his enemies, suggested Caleb. Good heavens, all of 4B, said Mr. Savaloy. In a burial mound, suggested Vincent. Really, I, I wouldn't put you to the trouble, said Mr. Savaloy. In a longship set on fire, on top of a heap of the bodies of his enemies, under a burial mound, said Cohen flatly. Nothing's too good for old Teach. But I assure you I feel fine, said Mr. Savaloy. Really, I, uh... Ronald Savaloy! Mr. Savaloy turned. Ah, oh, he said. Uh, yes, I see. If you would care to step this way. The palace and the horde froze and faded gently like a dream. It's funny, said Mr. Savaloy as he followed death. I didn't expect it to be this way. Few people ever expect it to be any way. Gritty black sand crunched under what Mr. Savaloy supposed he should still call his feet. Where is this? The desert. It was brilliantly lit, and yet the sky was midnight black. He stared at the horizon. How big is it? 
for some very big. For Lord Hong, for instance, it contains a lot of impatient ghosts. I thought Lord Hong didn't believe in ghosts. He may do so now. A lot of ghosts believe in Lord Hong. Oh, uh, what happens now? Come on, come on, haven't got all day, step lively, man. Mr. Savaloy turned round and looked up at the woman on the horse. It was a big horse, but then it was a big woman. She had plaits, a hat with horns on it, and a breastplate that must have been a week's work for an experienced panel beater. She gave him a look that was not unkind, but had impatience in every line. I'm sorry, he said. Says here, Ronald Savaloy, she said. The what? The what? Everyone I pick up, said the woman, leaning down, is called someone the something. What the are you? Um, I'm sorry, I... I'll put you down as Ronald the Apologetic, then. Come on, hop up. There's a war on. Got to be going. Where to? Says here, uh, quaffing, carousing, throwing axes at young women's hair. Oh, um, I, th I think perhaps there's been a bit of, um... Look, old chap, are you coming or what? Mr. Savaloy looked around at the black desert. He was totally alone. Death had gone about his essential business. He let her pull him up behind her. Have they got a library, perhaps? He asked hopefully, as the horse rose into the dark sky. Don't know. No one's ever asked. Evening classes, perhaps? I could start evening classes. What in? Um, well, anything, really. Table manners, perhaps? Is, is, is that allowed? I suppose so. I don't think anyone's ever asked that either. The Valkyrie turned in the saddle. You sure you're coming to the right afterlife? Mr. Savaloy considered the possibilities. Uh, on the whole, he said, I think it's worth a try. The crowd in the square were getting to their feet. They looked at all that remained of Lord Hong and at the horde. Butterfly and Lotus Blossom joined their father. Butterfly ran her hand over the cannon, looking for the trick. You see, said Two Flower, a little indistinctly, because he couldn't quite hear the sound of his own voice yet. I told you he was the great wizard. Butterfly tapped him on the shoulder. What about those? she said. A small procession was picking its way through the square. In front, Two Flower recognized, was something he'd once owned. It was a very cheap one, he said to no one in particular. I always thought there was something a little warped about it, to tell you the truth. It was followed by a slightly larger luggage, and then, in descending order of size, four little chests, the smallest being about the size of a lady's handbag. As it passed a prone Hung Hung Ease who'd been too stunned to flee, it paused to kick him in the ear before hurrying after the others. Two Flower looked at his daughters. Can they do that, he said, make new ones? I thought it needed carpenters. I suppose it learned many things in Ankh Morpork said Butterfly. The luggages clustered together in front of the steps. Then the luggage turned around and, after one or two sad backward glances, or what might have been glances if it had eyes, cantered away. By the time it reached the far side of the square, it was a blur. Hey, you, four eyes. Two flower turned. Cohen was advancing towards the steps. I remember you, he said. Do you know anything about Grand Viziering? Not a thing, Mr. Emperor Cohen. Good. The job's yours. Get cracking. First thing, I want a cup of tea. Thick enough to float a horseshoe. Three sugars in five minutes, right? A cup of tea in five minutes, said Two Flower. But that's not long enough even for a short ceremony. Cohen put a companionable arm around the little man's shoulders. There's a new ceremony, he said. It goes, tea up, love. Milk, sugar, donut. Want another one? And then you could tell the eunuchs, he added, that the emperor is a literal-minded man and used the phrase, heads will roll. Two flowers' eyes gleamed behind his cracked glasses. Somehow he liked the sound of that. It looked as though he was living in interesting times. The luggages sat quietly and waited. Fate sat back. The gods relaxed. A draw he announced, 
Oh, yes, you have appeared to win in Hung Hung, but you have had to lose your most valuable piece. Is that not so? I'm sorry, said the lady. I don't quite follow you. In so far as I understand this, uh, physics, said fate, I cannot believe that anything could be materialized in the university without dying almost instantly. It is one thing to hit a snowdrift, but quite another to hit a wall. I never sacrifice a pawn, said the lady. How can you hope to win without sacrificing the occasional pawn? Oh, I never play to win, she smiled, but I do play not to lose. Watch. The Council of Wizards gathered in front of the wall at the far end of the Great Hall and stared up at the thing which now covered half of it. Interesting effect, said Ridcully eventually. How fast do you think it was going? About five hundred miles an hour, said Ponder. I think perhaps we were a little enthusiastic. Hex says... From a standing start to five hundred miles an hour, said the lecturer in recent runes. That must have come as a shock. Yes, said Ridcully. Uh, but I suppose it's a mercy for the for the poor creature that it was such a brief one. And, of course, we must all be thankful that it wasn't rinse-wind. A couple of the wizards coughed. The dean stood back. But what is it, he said. Was, said Ponder Stibbons. We could have a look in the, in the mm, vestuaries, said Ridcully. Shouldn't be hard to find. Grey, long hind feet like a clown's boots, rabbit ears, tail long and pointy, and of course not many creatures are twenty feet across and one inch thick and deep fried. So that narrows it down a bit. I don't want to cast a shadow on things, said the dean, but if this isn't Rincewind, then where is he? I'm sure Mr. Stibbons can give us an explanation as to why his calculations went wrong, said Ridcully. Ponder's mouth dropped open. And then he said, as sourly as he dared, I probably forgot to take into account that there's three right angles and a triangle, didn't I? Uh, I'll have to try and work everything back, but I think that somehow a lateral component was introduced into what should have been a bidirectional sortilegic transfer. It's probably that this was most pronounced at the effective median point, causing an extra node to appear in the transfers at a point equidistant to the other two, as prediction in Flume's third equation and Turf's law would see to it that the distortion would stabilize in such a way as to create three separate points, each moving at roughly equal mass one jump around the triangle. <laughs> I'm not sure why the third mass arrived here at such speed, but I think the increased velocity might have been caused by the sudden creation of the node. <laughs> Of course, it might have been going quite fast anyway, but I shouldn't think it is cooked in its natural state. Do you know, said Ridcully, I think I actually understood some of that. Certainly, uh, some, of, some of the shorter words. Oh, it's, it's perfectly simple, said the bursar brightly. We sent the dog thing to Hung Hung, Rincewind was sent to some other place, and this creature was sent here, just like past the parcel. You see, said Ridcully to Stibbons, you're using language the bursar can understand, and, and, and he's been chasing the dried frog all morning. The librarian staggered into the hall under the weight of a large atlas. Ooh. At least you can show us where you think our man is, said Ridcully. Ponder took a ruler and a pair of compasses out of his hat. Well, if we assume Rincewind was in the middle of the counterweight continent, he said, then all we need to do is draw... Ooh, I assure you I was only going to use pencil. All we have to do is imagine, all right, a third point equidistant from the other two uh, that looks like somewhere in the rim ocean to me or probably over the edge. Can't see that thing in the sea, said Ridcully, glancing up at the recently laminated corpse. 
In that case, it must have been in the other direction. The wizards crowded round. There was something there. It's not even properly drawn in, said the dean. That's because no one's sure it really exists, said the senior wrangler. It floated in the middle of the sea, a tiny continent by Discworld standards. XXXX, Ponder read. They only put that on the map because no one knows what it's really called, said Ridcully. And we've sent him there, said Ponder, a place that we're not even certain exists. Oh, we, we know it exists now, said Ridcully. Must do, must do. Must be a pretty rich land, too, if the rats grow that big. I'll go and see if we can bring he Ponder began. Oh, no, said Ridcully firmly. No, thank you very much. Next time it might be an elephant whizzing over our heads, and those things make us splash. No. Uh, give the poor chap a rest. We'll have to think of something else. He rubbed his hands together. Time for dinner, I feel, he said. Um, said the senior wrangler, do you think we were wise to light that string when we sent the thing back? Certainly, said Ridcully, as they strolled away. No one could say we didn't uh, return it in exactly the same state as it arrived. Hex dreamed gently in its room. The wizards were right. Hex couldn't think. There weren't words yet for what it could do. Even Hex didn't know what it could do. But it was going to find out. The quill pen scritched and blotted its way over a fresh sheet of paper and drew for no good reason a calendar for the year surmounted by a rather angular picture of a beagle standing on its hind legs. The ground was red, just like it hung hung. But whereas that was a kind of clay so rich that leaving a chair on the lawn meant that you had four small trees by nightfall, this ground was sand that looked as if it had got red by being baked in a million year summer. There were occasional clumps of yellowed grass and low stands of grey-green trees. But what there was everywhere was heat. This was especially noticeable in the pond under the ghost gums. It was steaming. A figure emerged from the clouds, absent-mindedly picking the burnt bits off his beard. Rincewind waited until his own personal world had stopped spinning and concentrated on the four men who were watching him. They were black, with lines and walls painted on their faces, and had between them about two square feet of clothing. There were three reasons why Rincewind was no racist. He'd ended up in too many places too suddenly to develop that kind of mind. Besides, if he'd thought about it much, most of the really dreadful things that had happened to him had been done by quite pale people with big wardrobes. Those were two of the reasons. The third was that these men, who were just rising from a half-crouching position, were all holding spears, pointing at Rincewind, and there is something about the sight of four spears aimed at your throat that causes no end of respect, and the word, sir, to arise spontaneously in the mind. One of the men shrugged and lowered his spear. Good eye, bloke, he said. This meant only three spears, which was an improvement. Er, uh, this isn't unseen university, is it? Uh, sir? said Rincewind. The other spears stopped pointing at him. The men grinned. They had very white teeth. Clatch? Um, Hawanderland? It looks like Hawanderland, said Rincewind, hopefully. Dunno them blokes, bloke, said one of the men. The other three clustered around him. What'll we call him? He's kangaroo bloke. No worries there. One minute a kangaroo, next minute a bloke. The old blokes say that sort of thing used to happen all the time back in the dream. I reckon he'd look better than that. Yeah, one way to tell. The man who was apparently the leader of the group advanced on Rincewind with the kind of grin reserved for imbeciles and people holding guns, and held out a stick. It was flat and had a bend in the middle. Someone had spent a long time making rather nice designs on it in little coloured dots. Somehow Rincewind wasn't at all surprised to see a butterfly among them. The hunters watched him expectantly. Er, uh, yes, he said. Very good. Very good workmanship, yes. Interesting, pointillistic effect. Shame you couldn't find a straighter bit of wood. 
One of the men laid down his spear and squatted down and picked up a long wooden tube covered with the same designs. He blew into it. The effect was not unpleasant. It sounded like bees would sound if they'd invented a full orchestration. Um, said Rincewind. Yes. It was a test, obviously. They'd given him this bent piece of wood. He had to do something with it. It was clearly very important. He'd... Oh, no, he'd say something or do something, wouldn't he? And then they'd say, yes, you are the great bloke or something. And then they'd drag him off and it'd be the start of another adventure, i.e. a period of horror and unpleasantness. Life was full of tricks like that. Well, this time Rincewind wasn't going to fall for it. I want to go home, he said. I want to go back home to the library where it was nice and quiet. And I don't know where I am, and I don't care what you do to me, right? I'm not going to have any kind of adventure or start saving the world again, and you can't trick me into it with mysterious bits of wood. He gripped the stick and flung it away from him with all the force he could still muster. They stared at him as he folded his arms. I'm not playing, he said. I'm stopping right here. They were still staring, and now they were grinning, too, at something behind him. He felt himself getting quite annoyed. Do you understand? Are you listening, he said. That's the last time the universe is going to trick a rinse That is the end of Interesting Times by Terry Pratchett, and it was read by Nigel Planer. We do hope that you've enjoyed this audiobook. Don't forget that there are many more titles available, ranging from travel and biography to romance and the best of modern and classic fiction. If you would like further information, please write to us for a catalogue or ask your local library. Isis Audiobooks presents an unabridged recording of Masquerade, written by Terry Pratchett, read by Nigel Planer. The wind howled. The storm crackled on the mountains. Lightning prodded the crags like an old man trying to get an elusive blackberry pip out of his false teeth. Among the hissing firs bushes, a fire blazed, the flames driven this way and that by the gusts. An eldritch voice shrieked, When shall we, er, uh, two meet again? Thunder rolled. A rather more ordinary voice said, What you go and shout that for? You made me drop my toast in the fire. Nanny Og sat down again. Sorry, Esme. I was just doing it for, you know, old times' sake. Doesn't roll off the tongue, though. I've just got it nice and brown, too. Sorry. Anyway, you didn't have to shout. Sorry. I mean, I ain't deaf. You could have just asked me in a normal voice and I'd have said, Next Wednesday. Sorry, Esme. Just you cut me another slice. Nanny Og nodded and turned her head. Magrat, cut Granny another s- Oh, mind wandering there for a minute. I'll do it myself, shall I? Ha! said Granny Weatherwax, staring into the fire. There was no sound for a while but the roar of the wind and the sound of Nanny Og cutting bread which she did with about as much efficiency as a man trying to chainsaw a mattress. I thought it would cheer you up coming up here, she said after a while. Really? It wasn't the question. Take you out of yourself, sort of thing. Nanny went on, watching her friend carefully. Hmm? said Granny, still staring moodily at the fire. Oh, dear, thought Nanny. 
I shouldn't have said that. The point was... Well, the point was that Nanny Og was worried. Very worried. She wasn't at all sure that her friend wasn't, well, going, well, sort of, in a manner of speaking, well, black. She knew it happened with the really powerful ones, and Granny Weatherwax was pretty damn powerful. She was probably an even more accomplished witch now than the infamous Black Alice, and everyone knew what had happened to her at the finish. Pushed into her own stove by a couple of kids, and everyone said it was a damn good thing even if it took a whole week to clean the oven. But Alice, up until that terrible day, had terrorised the Ram Tots. She'd become so good at magic that there wasn't room in her head for anything else. They said weapons couldn't pierce her. Swords bounced off her skin. They said you could hear her mad laughter a mile off. And of course, while mad laughter was always part of a witch's stock in trade in necessary circumstances, this was insane mad laughter. The worst kind. And she turned people into gingerbread and had a house made of frogs. It had been very nasty towards the end. It always was when a witch went bad. Sometimes, of course, they didn't go bad. They just went somewhere. Granny's intellect needed something to do. She did not take kindly to boredom. She'd take to her bed instead and send her mind out borrowing inside the head of some forest creature, listening with its ears, seeing with its eyes. That was all very well for general purposes, but she was too good at it. She could stay away longer than anyone Nanny Og had ever heard of. One day, almost certainly, she wouldn't bother to come back. And this was the worst time of the year, with the geese honking and rushing across the sky every night, and the autumn air crisp and inviting. There was something terribly tempting about that. Nanny Og reckoned she knew what the cause of the problem was. She coughed. <coughs> Saw Magrat the other day, she ventured, looking sidelong at Granny. There was no reaction. She's looking well. Queening suits her. Hmm. Nanny groaned inwardly. If Granny couldn't even be bothered to make a nasty remark, then she was really missing Magrat. Nanny Og had never believed it at the start, but Magrat Garlic, wet as a sponge though she was half the time, had been dead right about one thing. Three was a natural number for witches, and they'd lost one. Well, not lost, exactly. Magrat was queen now, and queens were hard to mislay. But that meant that there were only two of them instead of three. When you had three, you had one to run around getting people to make up when there'd been a row. Magrat had been good for that. Without Magrat, Nanny Og and Granny Weatherwax got on one another's nerves. With her, all three had been able to get on the nerves of absolutely everyone else in the whole world, which had been a lot more fun. And there was no having Magrat back. At least, to be precise about it, there was no having Magrat back yet. Because while three was a good number for witches, it had to be the right sort of three. The right sort of types. Nanny Og found herself embarrassed even to think about this, and this was unusual because embarrassment normally came as naturally to Nanny as altruism comes to a cat. As a witch, she naturally didn't believe in any occult nonsense of any sort. But there were one or two truths down below the bedrock of the soul which had to be faced, and right in among them was this business of, well, of the maiden, the mother, and the, the, the other one. There. She'd put words around it. Of course, it was nothing but an old superstition, and belonged to the unenlightened days when maiden, or mother, or the other one, encompassed every woman over the age of twelve or so, except maybe for nine months of her life. These days, any girl bright enough to count, and sensible enough to take Nanny's advice, could put off being at least one of them for quite some time. Even so, it was an old superstition, older than books, older than writing and beliefs like that were heavy weights on the rubber sheet of human experience, tending to pull people into their orbit. And Magrat had been married for three months. That ought to mean she was out of the first category. At least Nanny twitched her train of thought onto a branch line. She probably was. Oh, surely. Young Verence had sent off for a helpful manual. It had pictures in it, and numbered parts. Nanny knew this because she had sneaked into the royal bedroom while visiting one day and had spent an instructive ten minutes drawing moustaches and spectacles on some of the figures. 
Surely even Magrat and Verence could hardly fail to... No, they must have worked it out. Even though Nanny had heard that Verence had been seen inquiring of people where he might buy a couple of false moustaches. It had not been long before Magrat was eligible for the second category, even if they were both slow readers. Of course, Granny Weatherwax made a great play of her independence and self-reliance. But the point about that kind of stuff was that you needed someone around to be proudly independent and self-reliant at. People who didn't need people needed people around to know that they were the kind of people who didn't need people. It was like hermits. There was no point in freezing your nadgers off on top of some mountain while communing with the infinite, unless you could rely on a lot of impressionable young women to come along occasionally and say, Gosh! They needed to be three again. Things got exciting when there were three of you. There were rows and adventures and things for Granny to get angry about. And she was only happy when she was angry. In fact, it seemed to Nanny she was only Granny Weatherwax when she was angry. Yes, they needed to be three. Or else it was going to be grey wings in the night or the clang of the oven door. The manuscript fell apart as soon as Mr. Goatburger picked it up. It wasn't even on proper paper. It had been written on old sugar bags and the backs of envelopes and bits of out-of-date calendar. He grunted and grabbed a handful of the musty pages to throw them on the fire. A word caught his eye. He read it and his eye was dragged to the end of the sentence. Then he read to the end of the page, doubling back a few times because he hadn't quite believed what he'd just read. He turned the page and then he turned back. And then he read on. At one point he took a ruler out of his drawer and looked at it thoughtfully. He opened his drinks cabinet. The bottle tinkled cheerfully on the edge of the glass as he tried to pour himself a drink. Then he stared out of the window at the opera house on the other side of the road. A small figure was brushing the steps. And then he said, Oh my! Finally he went to the door and said, could you come in here, Mr... I have to get Mr. Cripslock to engrave page 11 again, he said mournfully. He spelled famine with seven letters. Read this, said Goatburger. I was just off to lunch. Read this. Guild agreement says read this and see if you still have an appetite. Mr. Cropper sat down with bad grace and glanced at the first page. Then he turned to the second page. After a while, he opened the desk drawer and pulled out a ruler, which he looked at thoughtfully. You've just read about banana na soup surprise, said Goatburger. Yes. You wait till you get to Spotted Dick. Well, my old granny used to make Spotted Dick. Not to this recipe, said Goatburger with absolute certainty. Cropper fumbled through the pages. Blimey! Do you think any of this stuff works? Who cares? Go down to the guild right now and hire all the engravers that are free, preferably elderly ones. But I've still got the Groon, June, August and Sproon predictions for next year's almanac to... Forget them. Use some old ones. People will notice. They've never noticed before, said Mr Goatburger. You know the drill. Astounding rains of curry and clatch. Amazing death of the Seraph of E. Plague of wasps in her wonderland. This is a lot more important. He stared, unseeing, out of the window again. Considerably more important. And he dreamed the dream of all those who publish books, which was to have so much gold in your pockets that you would have to employ two people just to hold your trousers up. The huge... The columned, gargoyle-haunted face of Ankh Morpork's Opera House was there, in front of Agnes Knit. She stopped. At least, most of Agnes stopped. There was a lot of Agnes. It took some time for outlying regions to come to rest. Well, this was it, at last. She could go in, or she could go away. It was what they called a life choice. She'd never had one of those before. Finally, after standing still for long enough for a pigeon to consider the perching possibilities of her huge and rather sad black floppy hat, she climbed the steps. A man was theoretically sweeping them. 
What he was in fact doing was moving the dirt around with a broom to give it a change of scenery and a chance to make new friends. He was dressed in a long coat that was slightly too small for him and had a black beret perched incongruously on spiky black hair. Excuse me, said Agnes. The effect was electric. He turned round, tangled one foot with the other and collapsed onto his broom. Agnes's hand flew to her mouth and then she reached down. Oh, I'm so sorry. The hand had that clammy feel that makes a holder think longingly of soap. He pulled it away quickly, pushed his greasy hair out of his eyes and gave her a terrified smile. He had what Nanny Og called an underdone face, its features rubbery and pale. No trouble, miss. Are you all right? He scrambled up, got the broom somehow tangled between his knees and sat down again sharply. Uh, shall I hold the broom? said Agnes helpfully. She pulled it out of the tangle. He got up again after a couple of false starts. Do you work for the opera house? said Agnes. Yes, miss. He looked around wildly. Stage door, he said. I'll show you. The words came out in a rush, as if he had to line them up and fire them all in one go before they had time to wander off. He snatched the broom out of her hands and set off down the steps and towards the corner of the building. He had a unique stride. It looked as though his body were being dragged forward and his legs had to flail around underneath it, landing wherever they could find room. It wasn't so much a walk as a collapse, indefinitely postponed. His erratic footsteps led towards a door in the side wall. Agnes followed them in. Just inside was a sort of shed, with one open wall and a counter positioned so that someone standing there could watch the door. The person behind it must have been a human being because walruses don't wear coats. The strange man had disappeared somewhere in the gloom beyond. Agnes looked around desperately. Yes, miss, said the walrus man. It really was an impressive moustache, which had sapped all the growth from the rest of its owner. Uh, I'm here for the auditions, said Agnes. I saw a notice that said you were auditioning. Heh, <laughs> she gave a helpless little smile. The doorkeeper's face proclaimed that it had seen and been unimpressed by more desperate smiles than even Agnes could have eaten hot dinners. He produced a clipboard and a stub of pencil. You got the sign here, he said. Who was that person who came in with me? The moustache moved, suggesting a smile was buried somewhere below. Everyone knows our Walter Plinge. This seemed to be all the information that was likely to be imparted. Agnes gripped the pencil. The most important question was, what should she call herself? Her name had many sterling qualities, no doubt, but it didn't exactly roll off the tongue. It snapped off the palate and clicked between the teeth, but it didn't roll off the tongue. The trouble was, she couldn't think of one with great rotational capabilities. Catherine, possibly, or Perdita. She could go back to trying Perdita. She'd been embarrassed out of using that name in Lancre. It was a mysterious name, hinting of darkness and intrigue, and incidentally of someone who was quite thin. She'd even given herself a middle initial, X, which stood for someone who has a cool and exciting middle initial. It hadn't worked. Lancre people were depressingly resistant to cool. She'd just been known as that Agnes who calls herself Perditax. She'd never dared tell anyone that she'd like her full name to be Perdita X Dream. They just wouldn't understand. They'd say things like, If you think that's the right name for you, why have you still got two shelves full of soft toys? Well, here she could start afresh. She was good. She knew she was good. Probably no hope for the dream, though. She was probably stuck with the knit. Nanny Og usually went to bed early. After all, she was an old lady. Sometimes she went to bed as early as 6 a.m. Her breath puffed in the air as she walked through the woods. Her boots crunched on the leaves. The wind had died away, leaving the sky wide and clear and open for the first frost of the season. A petal-nipping, fruit-withering little scorcher that showed you why they called nature a mother. A third witch. Three witches could sort of spread the load. Maiden, mother, and crone. There. The trouble was that Granny Weatherwax combined all three in one. 
She was a maiden, as far as Nanny knew, and she was at least in the right age bracket for a crone. And as for the third, well, cross Granny Weatherwax on a bad day and you'd be like a blossom in the frost. There was bound to be a candidate for the vacancy, though. There were several young girls in Lancre who were just about the right age. Trouble was, the young men of Lancre knew it too. Nanny wandered the summer hayfields regularly and had a sharp if compassionate eye and damn good over the horizon hearing. Violet Frottage was walking out with young deviousness Carter, or at least doing something within 90 degrees of walking out. Bonnie Quarney had been gathering nuts in May with William Simple, and it was only because she'd thought ahead and taken a little advice from Nanny that she wouldn't be bearing fruit in February. And pretty soon now, young Mildred Tinker's mother would have a quiet word with Mildred Tinker's father, and he'd have a word with his friend Thatcher, and he'd have a word with his son Hob. And then there'd be a wedding, all done in a properly civilised way, except for maybe a black eye or two. The people of Lancre thought that marriage was a very serious step that ought to be done properly, so they practised quite a lot. No doubt about it, thought Nanny with a misty-eyed smile, innocence in a hot Lancre summer was that state in which innocence is lost. And then a name rose out of the throng. Oh, yes, her. Why hadn't she thought of her? But you didn't, of course. Whenever you thought about the young girls of Lancre, you didn't remember her. And then you said, Oh, yes, her too, of course, of course. She's got a wonderful personality and good hair, of course. She was bright and talented in many ways. Her voice, for one thing. That was her power, finding its way out. And, of course, she also had a wonderful personality, so there'd be not much chance of her being disqualified. Well, that was settled then. Another witch to bully and impress would set Granny up a treat, and Agnes would be bound to thank her eventually. Nanny Og was relieved. You needed at least three witches for a coven. Two witches was just an argument. She opened the door of her cottage and climbed the stairs to bed. Her cat, the Tom Grebo, was spread out on the eiderdown like a puddle of grey fur. He didn't even awake as Nanny lifted him up bodily so that nightdress clad she could slide between the sheets. Just to keep bad dreams at bay, she took a swig out of a bottle that smelled of apples and happy brain death. Then she pummeled her pillow, thought, her, yes, and drifted off to sleep. Presently, Grebo awoke, stretched, yawned and hopped silently to the floor. Then, the most vicious and cunning a pile of fur that ever had the intelligence to sit on a bird table with its mouth open and a piece of toast balanced on its nose, vanished through the open window. A few minutes later, the cockerel in the garden next door stuck up his head to greet the bright new day and died instantly mid-doodle-doo. There was a huge darkness in front of Agnes, while at the same time she was half-blinded by the light. Just below the edge of the stage, giant flat candles floated in a long trough of water, producing a strong yellow glare, quite unlike the oil lamps of home. Beyond the light, the auditorium waited like the mouth of a very big and extremely hungry animal. From somewhere on the far side of the lights, a voice said, When you're ready, miss. It wasn't a particularly unfriendly voice. It just wanted her to get on with it, sing her piece and go. Uh, I've got this song. It's a... Uh, You've given your music to Miss Proudlet? Uh, there isn't an accompaniment, actually. It, oh, it's a folk song, is it? There was a whispering in the darkness, and someone laughed quietly. Off you go, then. Perdita, right? Agnes launched into the hedgehog song, and knew by about word seven that it had been the wrong choice. You needed a tavern, with people leering and thumping their mugs on the table. This big, brilliant emptiness just sucked at it and made her voice hesitant and shrill. She stopped at the end of verse three. She could feel the blush starting from somewhere around her knees. It had take some time to get to her face, because it had a lot of skin to cover, but by then it would be strawberry pink. She could hear whispering, words like timbre emerged from the susuration, and then, she wasn't surprised to hear, came impressive build. She did, she knew, have an impressive build. So did the opera house. She didn't have to feel good about it. The voice spoke up. 
You haven't had much training, have you, dear? No, which was true. Lankra's only other singer of note was Nanny Ogg, whose attitude to songs was purely ballistic. You just pointed your voice at the end of the verse and went for it. Whisper, whisper. Sing us a few scales, dear. The blush was at chest height now, thundering across the rolling acres. Scales? Whisper. Muffled laugh. Do re me. You know, dear, starting low, la la la. Oh, yes. As the armies of embarrassment stormed her neckline, Agnes pitched her voice as low as she could and went for it. She concentrated on the notes, working her way stolidly upwards from sea level to mountain top, and took no notice at the start when a chair vibrated across the stage, or at the end when a glass broke somewhere and several bats fell out of the roof. There was silence from the big emptiness, except for the thud of another bat and far above a gentle tinkle of glass. Is... is that your full range, lass? People were clustering in the wings and staring at her. No. No. If I go any higher, people faint, said Agnes, and if I go any lower, everyone says it makes them feel uncomfortable. Whisper, 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 whisper. And, uh, any other... I can sing with myself in thirds. Nanny Og says not everyone can do that. Sorry? Like, go me at the same time. Whisper, whisper. Show us, lass. La... La... The people at the side of the stage were talking excitedly. Whisper, whisper. The voice from the darkness said... Now your voice projection. Oh, I can do that, snapped Agnes. She was getting rather fed up. Where would you like it projected? I'm sorry, we're talking about... Agnes ground her teeth. She was good and she'd show them. To here? Or there? Or here? Up here? It wasn't that much of a trick, she thought. It could be very impressive if you put the words in the mouth of a nearby dummy like some of the travelling showmen did, but you couldn't pitch it far away and still manage to fool a whole audience. Now that she was accustomed to the gloom, she could just make out people turning around in their seats, bewildered. What's your name again, dear? The voice which had at one point shown traces of condescension had a distinct beaten-up sound. Agni... Um, <clears throat> per... Perdita, said Agnes. Perdita, nit. Perdita, ex, nit. We may have to do something about the knit, dear. Granny Weatherwax's door opened by itself. Jarge Weaver hesitated. Of course, she were a witch. People told him this sort of thing happened. He didn't like it, but he didn't like his back either, especially when his back didn't like him. It came to something when your vertebrae ganged up on you. He eased himself forward, grimacing, balancing himself on two sticks. The witch was sitting in a rocking chair, facing away from the door. Jarge hesitated. Come on in, Jarge Weaver, said Granny Weatherwax, and let me give you something for that back of yours. The shock made him try to stand upright, and this made something white-hot explode somewhere in the region of his belt. Granny Weatherwax rolled her eyes and sighed. Can you sit down? No, miss. I can fall over on a chair, though. Granny produced a small black bottle from an apron pocket and shook it vigorously. Jarge's eyes widened. You got all that ready for me, he said. Yes, said Granny truthfully. She'd long ago been resigned to the fact that people expected a bottle of something funny-coloured and sticky. It wasn't the medicine that did the trick, though. It was, in a way, the spoon. This is a mixture of rare herbs and such like, she said including sacrose and aqua. My word, said Jarge, impressed. Take a swig now. He obeyed. It tasted faintly of licorice. You got to take another swig last thing at night, Granny went on, and then walk three times round a chestnut tree. <laughs> three times round a chestnut tree. And, and... Put a pine board under your mattress. Got to be pine from a twenty-year-old tree, mind. Twenty-year-old tree, said Jarge, 
he felt he should make a contribution. So the knots in me back end up in the pine, he hazarded. Granny was impressed. It was an outrageously ingenious bit of folk hokum worth remembering for another occasion. You got it exactly right, she said. And that's it. You wanted more? Uh, I thought they were dancing and, and, and chanting and stuff. Did that before you got here, said Granny. Oh, my word. Uh, yes. Um, um, about paying. Oh, I don't want paying, said Granny. It's bad luck taking money. Oh, uh, right, Jarge brightened up. But um, maybe if your wife's got any old clothes, perhaps uh, I'm a size 12, black for preference, or, or bakes the odd cake, no plums, and they gives me winged, or got a bit of old mead put by, could be, or perhaps you'll be killing a hog about now. Best back's my favourite. Maybe some ham, uh, a few pig knuckles, anything you can spare, really. No obligation. I wouldn't go around putting anyone under obligation just because I'm a witch. Everyone all right in your house, are they? Blessed with good health, I hope? She watched this sink in. And now let me help you out of the door, she added. Weaver was never quite certain about what happened next. Granny, usually so sure on her feet, seemed to trip over one of his sticks as she went through the door and fell backward, holding his shoulders, and somehow her knee came up and hit a spot on his backbone as she twisted sideways, and there was a click. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> me back, me back. Still, Jarge reasoned later, she was an old woman, and she might be getting clumsy, and she'd always been daft. But she made good potions. They worked damn fast, too. He was carrying his sticks by the time he got home. Granny watched him go, shaking her head. People were so blind, she reflected, they preferred to believe in gibberish rather than chiropractic. Of course, it was just as well this was so. She'd much rather they went ooh when she seemed to know who was approaching her cottage than work out that it conveniently overlooked a bend in the track. And as for the door latch and the trick with the length of black thread... Not that she sat looking out of the window, she'd been watching the fire when she picked up the approach of Jarge Weaver, but that wasn't the point. But what had she done? She'd just tricked a rather dim old man. She'd faced wizards, monsters and elves, and now she was feeling pleased with herself because she'd fooled Jarge Weaver, a man who twice failed to become village idiot through being overqualified. It was the slippery slope. Next thing, it'd be cackling and gibbering and luring children into the oven. And it wasn't as if she even liked children. For years, Granny Weatherwax had been contented enough with the challenge that village witchcraft could offer. And then she'd been forced to go travelling. And she'd seen a bit of the world, and it had made her itchy. Especially at this time of the year, when the geese were flying overhead, and the first frost had mugged innocent leaves in the deeper valleys. She looked around at the kitchen. It needed sweeping. The washing up needed doing. The walls had grown grubby. There seemed to be so much to do that she couldn't bring herself to do any of it. There was a honking far above, and a ragged V of geese sped over the clearing. They were heading for warmer weather in places Granny Weatherwax had only heard about. It was tempting. End of Side One Side two. The selection committee sat around the table in the office of Mr. Seldom Bucket, the Opera House's new owner. He'd been joined by Sal Zeller, the musical director, and Dr. Undershaft, the chorus master. And so, said Mr. Bucket, we come to... Now, let's see. Uh, yeah. 
Christine. Marvellous stage presence and, uh, good figure too. He winked at Dr. Undershaft. Yes, very pretty, said Dr. Undershaft flatly. Can't sing, though. What you, um, artistic types don't realise is this is the century of the fruit bat, said Bucket. Opera is a production, not just a lot of songs. So you say, but the idea that a soprano should be fifteen acres of bosom in a horned helmet belongs to the past, like. Salzella and Undershaft exchanged glances. So he was going to be that kind of owner. Unfortunately, said Salzella sourly, the idea that a soprano should have a reasonable singing voice does not belong to the past. She has a good figure, yes. She certainly has a sparkle. But she can't sing. You can train her, can't you? said Bucket. A few years in the chorus? Yes. Maybe after a few years, if I persevere, she will be nearly very bad, said Undershaft. Um, uh, gentlemen, said Mr. Bucket. Ahem. All right, cards on the table, eh? I'm a simple man, me. No beating about the bush. Uh, speak as you find. Call a spade a spade. Do give us your forthright views, said Salzella. Definitely that kind of owner, he thought. Self-made man, proud of his handiwork, confuses bluffness and honesty with merely being rude. I wouldn't mind betting a dollar that he thinks he can tell a man's character by testing the firmness of his handshake and looking deeply into his eyes. I've been through the mill, I have, Bucket began, and I made myself, um, what I am today. Self-raising flower, thought Salzella. But I have to, um, <laughs> declare a bit of a financial interest. Her dad did, uh, in fact, uh, lend me uh, a fair whack of money to help me buy this place, and he made a heartfelt fatherly request in regard to his daughter. I if I bring it to mind correctly, his exact words were, uh, uh, don't make me have to break your legs. <laughs> I don't expect you artists to understand, it's, it's a business thing. Uh, the gods help those who help themselves, that's my motto. Salzella stuck his hands in his waistcoat pockets, leaned back, and started to whistle softly. I see, said Undershaft. Well, it's not the first time it's happened. Normally, it's a ballerina, of course. Oh, it, it's nothing like that, said Bucket hurriedly. It's just that uh, with the money comes this girl, Christine, and, and, and you have to admit she does look good. Oh, very well, said Salzella. It's your opera house, I'm sure. And now, Perdita? They smiled at one another. Perdita, said Bucket, relieved to get the Christine business over so that he could go back to being bluff and honest again. Perdita X, Salzella corrected him. What will these girls think of next? I think she will prove an asset, said Undershaft. Yes, if we ever do that opera with the elephants. But the range... Hmm. What a range she's got. Quite. I saw you staring. I meant her voice, Salzella. She will add body to the chorus. She is a chorus. We could sack everyone else. Ye gods, she can even sing in harmony with herself. But can you see her in a major role? Good grief. No, we'd be a laughing stock. Quite so. She seems quite amenable, though. Wonderful personality, I thought, and good hair, of course. She'd never expected it to be this easy. Agnes listened in a kind of trance while people talked at her about wages, very little, and the need for training, a lot, and accommodation. Members of the chorus lived in the opera house itself, up near the roof. And then, more or less, she was forgotten about. She stood and watched at the side of the stage while a group of ballet hopefuls were put through their delicate paces. You do have an amazing voice, said someone behind her. She turned. As Nanny Og had once remarked, it was an education seeing Agnes turn round. 
She was light enough on her feet, but the inertia of outlying parts meant that bits of Agnes were still trying to work out which way to face for some time afterwards. The girl who had spoken to her was slightly built, even by ordinary standards, and had gone to some pains to make herself look even thinner. She had long, blonde hair, and the happy smile of someone who is aware that she is thin and has long, blonde hair. My name's Christine, she said. <laughs> Isn't this exciting? And she had the type of voice that can exclaim a question. It seemed to have an excited little squeak permanently screwed to it. Er, uh, yes, said Agnes. I've been waiting for this day for years. Agnes had been waiting for it for about twenty-four hours, ever since she'd seen the notice outside the opera house. But she'd be danged if she'd say that. Where did you train? said Christine. I spent three years with Madame Venturi at the Quirm Conservatory. Um, I was... Agnes hesitated, trying out the upcoming sentence in her head. I trained with Dame Og. But she hasn't got a conservatory, because it's hard to get the glass up the mountain. Christine didn't appear to want to question this. Anything she found too difficult to understand, she ignored. The money in the chorus isn't very good, is it? She said. No. It was less than you'd get for scrubbing floors. The reason was that when you advertised a dirty floor, hundreds of hopefuls didn't turn up. But it's what I've always wanted to do. Besides, there's the status. Yes, I expect there is. I've been to look at the rooms we get. They're very pokey. What room have you been given? Agnes looked down blankly at the keys she had been handed, along with many sharp instructions about no men, and an unpleasant not-that-you-need-telling expression on the chorus mistress's face. Oh, seventeen. Christine clapped her hands. Oh, goody. Pardon? I'm so glad you're next to me. Agnes was taken aback. She'd always been resigned to being the last to be picked in the great team game of life. Oh, yes, I suppose so, she said. You're so lucky you've got such a majestic figure for opera, and such marvellous hair, the way you pile it up like that. Black suits you, by the way. Majestic, thought Agnes. It was a word that would never, ever have occurred to her. And she'd always steered away from white, because in white she looked like a washing line on a windy day. She followed Christine. It occurred to Agnes, as she trudged after the girl en route to her new lodgings, that if you spent much time in the same room as Christine, you'd need to open a window to stop from drowning in punctuation. From somewhere at the back of the stage, quite unheeded, someone watched them go. People were generally glad to see Nanny Og. She was good at making them feel at home in their own home. But she was a witch, and therefore also expert at arriving just after cakes were baked or sausages were made. Nanny Og generally travelled with a string bag stuffed up one knee-length knicker leg, in case, as she put it, someone wants to give me something. So, Mrs. Knit, she observed, around about the third cake and fourth cup of tea. How's that, um, <clears throat> daughter of yours, <laughs> Agnes, it is to whom I refer? Oh, didn't you hear, Mrs. Ogg? She's gone off to Ogg Moorpork to be a singer. Nanny Ogg's heart sank. That's nice, she said. She had a good singing voice, I remember. Of course, I gave her a few tips. I used to hear her singing in the woods. It's the air here, said Mrs. Knit. She's always had such a good chest. Yes, indeed. Noted for it. So she's not here, then. You know our Agnes. She never says much. I think she thought it was a bit dull. Dull? Lankra? said Nanny Og. That's what I said, said Mrs. Knit. I said we get some lovely sunsets up here. And there's the fair... Every Soul Cake Tuesday, regular. Nanny Og thought about Agnes. He needed quite large thoughts to fit all of Agnes in. Lunkra had always bred strong, capable women. A Lunkra farmer needed a wife who'd think nothing of beating a wolf to death with her apron when she went out to get some firewood. And while kissing initially seemed to have more charms than cookery, a stolid Lunkra lad, looking for a bride, would bear in mind his father's advice that kisses eventually lost their fire, but cookery tended to get even better over the years, and direct his courting to those families that clearly showed a tradition of enjoying their food. 
Agnes was, Nanny considered, quite good-looking in an expansive kind of way. She was a fine figure of typical young Lancre womanhood. This meant she was approximately two womanhoods from anywhere else. Nanny also recalled her being rather thoughtful and shy, as if trying to reduce the amount of worlds she took up. But she had shown signs of craft ability. That was only to be expected. There was nothing like that not-fitting-in feeling to stimulate the old magical nerves. That was why Esme was so good at it. In Agnes's case, this had manifested itself in a tendency to wear soppy black lace gloves and pale makeup and call herself Perdita, plus an initial from the arse of the alphabet. But Nanny had assumed that would soon burn off when she got some serious witchcraft under her rather strained belt. She should have paid more attention to the thing about music. Power found its way out by all sorts of routes. Music and magic had a lot in common. They were only two letters apart from one thing, and you couldn't do both. Damn! Nanny had rather been counting on the girl. She used to send off to Aunt Morpork for music, said Mrs. Nitt. See? She handed Nanny several piles of papers. Nanny leafed through them. Song sheets were common enough in the ram tops, and a sing-song in the parlour was considered the third best thing to do on long dark evenings, but Nanny could see this wasn't ordinary music. It was far too crowded for that. Cosy Van Heter, she read, the Meister Singer von Scrota. That's foreign, said Mrs. Nitt proudly. It certainly is, said Nanny. Mrs. Nitt was looking expectantly at her. What? said Nanny. And then, oh! Mrs. Nitt's eyes flickered to her emptied teacup and back again. Nanny Og sighed and laid the music aside. Occasionally she saw Granny Weatherwax's point. Sometimes people expected too little of witches. Yes, indeedy, she said, trying to smile. Let us see what destiny in the form of those dried-up bits of leaf has in store for us, eh? She set her features in a suitable occult expression and looked down into the cup, which, a second later, smashed into fragments when it hit the floor. It was a small room. In fact, it was half a small room, since a thin wall had been built across it. Julia members of the chorus ranked rather lower than apprentice scene shifters in the opera. There was room for a bed, a wardrobe, a dressing table, and quite out of place a huge mirror as big as the door. Impressive, isn't it? said Christine. They tried to take it out, but it's built into the wall, apparently. I'm sure it would be very useful. Agnes said nothing. Her own half room, the other half of this one, didn't have a mirror. She was glad of that. She did not regard mirrors as naturally friendly. It wasn't just the images they showed her. There was something worrying about mirrors. She'd always felt that. They seemed to be looking at her. Agnes hated being looked at. Christine stepped into the small space in the middle of the floor and twirled. There was something very enjoyable about watching her. It was the sparkle, Agnes thought. Something about Christine suggested sequins. Isn't this nice, she said. Not liking Christine would be like not liking small fluffy animals. And Christine was just like a small fluffy animal, a rabbit perhaps. It was certainly impossible for her to get a whole idea into her head in one go. She had to nibble it into manageable bits. Agnes glanced at the mirror again. Her reflection stared at her. She could have done with some time to herself right now. Everything had happened so quickly, and this place made her uneasy. Everything would feel a lot better if she could just have some time to herself. Christine stopped twirling. You all right? Agnes nodded. Do tell me about yourself. Uh, well, Agnes was gratified despite herself. I'm from somewhere up in the mountains. You've probably never heard of. She stopped. A light had gone off in Christine's head, and Agnes realized that the question had been asked not because Christine in any way wanted to know the answer, but for something to say. She went on. And my father is the Emperor of Clatch, and my mother is a small tray of raspberry puddings. That's interesting, said Christine, who was looking at the mirror. Do you think my hair looks right? What Agnes would have said, if Christine had been capable of listening to anything for more than a couple of seconds, was she'd woken up one morning with the horrible realization that she'd been saddled with a lovely personality. It was as simple as that. Oh, and very good hair. It wasn't so much the personality, it was the but that people always added when they talked about it. 
But she's got a lovely personality, they said. It was the lack of choice that rankled. No one had asked her before she was born whether she wanted a lovely personality, or whether she'd prefer, say, a miserable personality, but a body that could take size nine in dresses. Instead, people would take pains to tell her that beauty was only skin deep, as if a man ever fell for an attractive pair of kidneys. She could feel a future trying to land on her. She'd caught herself saying poot and dang when she wanted to swear and using pink writing paper. She'd got a reputation for being calm and capable in a crisis. Next thing she knew, she'd be making shortbread and apple pies as good as her mother's, and then there'd be no hope for her. So she'd introduced Perdita. She'd heard somewhere that inside every fat woman was a thin woman trying to get out, or at least dying for a chocolate. So she'd named her Perdita. She was a good repository for all those thoughts that Agnes couldn't think on account of her wonderful personality. Perdita would use black writing paper if she could get away with it, and would be beautifully pale instead of embarrassingly flushed. Perdita wanted to be an interestingly lost soul in plum-coloured lipstick. Just occasionally, though, Agnes thought Perdita was as dumb as she was. Was the only alternative the witches? She'd felt their interest in her in a way she couldn't exactly identify. It was of a piece with knowing when someone was watching you, although she had, in fact, occasionally seen Nanny Og watching her in a critical kind of fashion, like someone inspecting a second-hand horse. She knew she did have some talent. Sometimes she knew things that were going to happen, although always in a sufficiently confused way that the knowledge was totally useless until afterwards. And there was her voice. She was aware it wasn't quite natural. She'd always enjoyed singing, and somehow her voice had just done everything she'd wanted it to do. But she'd seen the ways the witches lived. Oh, Nanny Og was all right, quite a nice old baggage, really. But the others were weird, lying crosswise on the world instead of nicely parallel to it like everyone else. Old Mother Dismas, who could see into the past and the future but was totally blind in the present. And Millie Hopwood over in Slice, who stuttered and had runny ears, and as for Granny Weatherwax. Oh, yes, finest job in the world, being a sour old woman with no friends. They were always looking for weird people like themselves. Well, they could look in vain for Agnes Knit. Fed up with living in Lancre, and fed up with the witches, and above all, fed up with being Agnes Knit, she'd escaped. Nanny Og didn't look built for running but she covered the ground deceptively fast, her great heavy boots kicking up shoals of leaves. There was a trumpeting overhead. Another skein of geese passed across the sky, so fast in pursuit of the summer that their wings were hardly moving in the ballistic rush. Granny Weatherwax's cottage looked deserted. It had, Nanny felt, a particularly empty feel. She scurried around to the back door and burst through, pounded up the stairs, saw the gaunt figure on the bed, reached an instant conclusion, grabbed the pitcher of water from its place on the marble washstand, ran forward. A hand shot up and grabbed her wrist. I was having a nap, said Granny, opening her eyes. Githa, I swear I could feel you coming half a mile away. <gasps> oh, we've got to make a cup of tea. Quick, gasped Nanny, almost sagging with relief. Granny Weatherwax was more than bright enough not to ask questions. But she couldn't hurry a good cup of tea. Nanny Og jiggled from one foot to the other while the fire was pumped up, the small frogs fished out of the water bucket, the water boiled, the dried leaves allowed to seep. I ain't saw nothing, said Nanny, sitting down at last. Just pour a cup, that's all. On the whole, witches despised fortune-telling from tea leaves. Tea leaves are not uniquely fortunate in knowing what the future holds. They are really just something for the eyes to rest on while the mind does the work. Practically anything would do. The scum on a puddle, the skin on a custard, anything. Nanny Og could see the future in the froth on a beer mug. It invariably showed that she was going to enjoy a refreshing drink, which she almost certainly was not going to pay for. You recall young Agnes Knit, said Nanny, as Granny Weatherwax tried to find the milk. Granny hesitated. Agnes, who calls herself Perditax? Perdita X said Nanny. She at least respected anyone's right to recreate themselves. Granny shrugged. Fat girl, big hair, walks with her feet turned out, sings to herself in the woods, good voice, reads books, says poot instead of swearing, blushes when anyone looks at her, wears black lace gloves with the fingers cut out. 
You remember we once talked about maybe how she possibly might be mm, suitable? Oh, there's a twist in the soul there, you're right, said Granny. But uh, it's an unfortunate name. Her father's name was Terminal, said Nanny Og reflectively. There were three sons, Primal, Medial and Terminal. I'm afraid the family's always had a problem with education. I meant Agnes, said Granny. Always puts me in mind of Carpet Fluff, that name. Probably that's why she called herself Perdita, said Nanny. Worse. Got her fixed in your mind, said Nanny. Yes, I suppose so. Good. Now, look at them tea leaves. Granny looked down. There was no particular drama, perhaps because of the way Nanny had built up expectations, but Granny did hiss between her teeth. Well, now, there's a thing, she said. See it? See it? Yep. Like a skull? Yep. And them eyes? I nearly... I was pretty damn surprised by them eyes, I can tell you. Granny carefully replaced the cup. Her mum showed me her letters home, said Nanny. I brought them with me. It's worrying, Esme. She could be facing something bad. She's a lunkra girl, one of ours. Nothing's too much trouble when it's one of your own, I always say. Tea leaves can't tell the future, said Granny quietly. Everyone knows that. Tea leaves don't know. Well, who'd be so daft as to tell anything to a bunch of dried leaves? Nanny Og looked down at Agnes's letters home. They were written in the careful rounded script of someone who'd been taught to write as a child by copying letters on a slate, and had never written enough as an adult to change their style. The person writing them had also very conscientiously drawn faint pencil lines on the paper before writing. Dear ma'am, I hope this finds you as it leaves me. Here I am in Ankmore Pork and everything is all right. I have not been ravished yet. I am staying at 4 Treacle Mine Road. It is all right. And Granny tried another. Dear Mum, I hope you are well. Everything is fine, but the money runs away like water here. I am doing some singing in taverns, but I am not making much, so I went to see the Guild of Seamstresses about getting a sewing job, and I took along some stitching to show them, and you'd be amazed. That's all I can say. And another. Dear Mother, some good news at last. Next week they are holding auditions at the Opera House. What's... Opera, said Granny Weatherwax. It's like theatre with singing, said Nanny Og. Huh? Theatre, said Granny darkly. Our Nev told me about it. It's all singing in foreign languages, he said. He couldn't understand any of it. Granny put down the letters. Yes, but your Nev can't understand a lot of things. What was he doing at this opera theatre anyway? Nicking the lead off the roof. Nanny said this quite happily. It wasn't theft if an og was doing it. Can't tell much from the letters except that she's picking up an education, said Granny. But it's a long way to... There was a hesitant knock on the door. It was Sean Og, Nanny's youngest son, and Lonkra's entire civil and public service. Currently he had his postman's badge on. The Lonkra postal service consisted of taking the mailbag off the nail where the coach left it, and delivering it to the outlying homesteads when he had a moment, although many citizens were in the habit of going down to the sack and rummaging until they found some mail they liked. He touched his helmet respectfully at Granny Weatherwax. Got a lot of letters, Mum, he said to Nanny Og. Uh, they're all addressed to, uh, uh, well, you'd better have a look, Mum. Nanny Og looked at the proffered bundle. The Lunker Witch, she said aloud. That'd be me, then, said Granny Weatherwax firmly, and took the letters. Oh, well, I'd uh, better be going, said Nanny, backing towards the door. Can't imagine why people would be writing to me, said Granny, slitting an envelope. Still, I suppose news gets around. She focused on the words. Dear Witch, she read, I would just like to say how much I appreciated the famous carrot and oyster pie recipe. My husband... Nanny Og made it halfway down the path before her boots became suddenly too heavy to lift. Githa Og, you come back here right now! Agnes tried again. 
She didn't really know anyone in Arkmore Pork, and she did need someone to talk to, even if they didn't listen. I suppose, mainly, I came because of the witches, she said. Christine turned, her eyes wide with fascination. So was her mouth. It was like looking at a rather pretty bowling ball. Witches, she breathed. Oh, yes, said Agnes wearily. Yes, people were always fascinated by the idea of witches. They should try living around them, she thought. Do they do spells and, and ride around on broomsticks? Oh, yes. No wonder you ran away. What? Oh, no, it's not like that. I mean, they're not bad. It's much worse than that. Worse than bad? They think they know what's best for everybody. Christine's forehead wrinkled as it tended to when she was contemplating a problem more complex than what is your name. That doesn't sound very bad. They mess people around. They think that just because they're right, that's the same as good. It's not even as though they do any real magic. It's all fooling people and being clever. They think they can do what they like. The force of the words knocked even Christine back. Oh dear! Did they want you to do something? They want me to be something, but I'm not going to. Christine stared at her, and then automatically forgot everything she'd just heard. Come on, she said. Let's have a look around. Nanny Og balanced on a chair and took down an oblong wrapped in paper. Granny watched sternly with her arms folded. Thing is, Nanny babbled under the laser glare, my late husband, I remember him once saying to me, after dinner, he said, You know, Mother, it would be a real shame if all the stuff you know just passed away when you did. Why don't you write some of it down? So I, I scribbled the odd one uh, when I had a moment, and, and then I thought it would be nice to have it all properly done. So I sent it off to the almanac people in Unc Moorpork, and they hardly charged me anything. And a little while ago they sent me this. I think it's a very good job. Amazing how they get all the letters so neat. You done a book, said Granny. Only cookery, said Nanny Og meekly, as one might plead a first offence. What do you know about it? You hardly ever do any cooking, said Granny. I do specialities, said Nanny. Granny looked at the offending volume. The Joy of Snacks, she read aloud. By a Lankra Witch. Heh! <laughs> Why didn't you put your own name on it, eh? Books gotta have a name on them so as everyone knows who's guilty. It's my name de plum, said Nanny. Mr. Gortberger, the almanac man, said it would make it sound more mysterious. Granny cast her gimlet gaze to the bottom of the crowded cover, where it said in very small lettering, CXXV one month printing, more than twenty thousand sold, one half dollar. You sent them some money to get it all printed? Only a couple of dollars, said Nanny. Damn good job they made of it, too. And they sent the money back afterwards, only they got it wrong, and sent three dollars extra. Granny Weatherwax was grudgingly literate, but keenly numerate. She assumed that anything written down was probably a lie, and that applied to numbers, too. Numbers were used only by people who wanted to put one over on you. Her lips moved silently as she thought about numbers. Oh, she said quietly. And that was it, was it? You never wrote to him again? Not on your life. Three dollars, mind. I didn't want him saying you wanted them back. No, I can see that, said Granny, still dwelling in the world of numbers. She wondered how much it cost to do a book. It couldn't be a lot. They had sort of printing mills to do the actual work. After all, there's a lot you can do with three dollars, said Nanny. Right enough, said Granny. You ain't got a pencil about you, have you? You being a literary type and all. I got a slate, said Nanny. Pass it over then. I've been keeping it by me in case I wake up in the night and I get an idea for a recipe. See? said Nanny. Good, said Granny vaguely. The slate pencil squeaked across the grey tablet. The paper must cost something, and you'd probably have to tip someone a couple of pennies to sell it. Angular figures danced from column to column. Well, um, oh, I'll make a cup of tea, shall I? said Nanny, relieved that the conversation appeared to be coming to a peaceful end. Hmm? said Granny. She stared at the result and drew two lines under it. But you enjoyed it, did you? she called out. The writing? 
Nanny Og poked her head around the scullery door. Oh, yes. The money didn't matter, she said. You've never been very good at numbers, have you? said Granny. Now she drew a circle around the final figure. Oh, you know me, Esme, said Nanny cheerfully. I couldn't subtract a fart from a plate of beans. That's good, because I reckon this master goat burger owes you a bit more than you got, if there's any justice in the world, said Granny. Money ain't everything, Esme. What I say is, if you've got your health, I reckon if there's any justice, it's about four or five thousand dollars, said Granny quietly. There was a crash from the scullery. So it's a good job the money don't matter, Granny Weatherwax went on. It'd be a terrible thing otherwise, all that money mattering. Nanny Og's white face appeared round the edge of the door. He never. Could be a bit more, said Granny. It never. You just adds up and divides and that. Nanny Og stared in horrified fascination at her own fingers. But that's her. She stopped. The only word she could think of was fortune, and that wasn't adequate. Witches didn't operate in a cash economy. The whole of the Rantops, by and large, got by without the complications of capital. Fifty dollars was a fortune. A hundred dollars was a was a well. It was two fortunes. That was what it was. It's a lot of money, she said weakly. What couldn't I do with money like that? Dunno. Said Granny Weatherwax. What did you do with the three dollars? Got it in a tin up the chimney. Said Nanny Og. Granny nodded approvingly. This was the kind of good fiscal practice she liked to see. Beats me why people had fall over themselves to read a cookery book, though. She added. I mean, it's not the sort of thing. The room fell silent. Nanny Og shuffled her boots. End of side two. Side three. Granny said in a voice laden with a suspicion that was all the worse because it wasn't quite yet sure what it was suspicious of. It is a cookery book, isn't it? Oh yes," said Nanny hurriedly, avoiding Granny's gaze. "Yes,、uh, recipes and that. Yes." Granny glared at her. "Just recipes? Yes. Oh yes.、Uh, yes and." Um, some cookery anecdotes. Yes. Granny went on blaring. Nanny gave in. Ah,、uh, look under famous carrot and oyster pie. She said, page twenty-five. Granny turned the pages. Her lips moved silently. Then, I see. Anything else? Um. Cinnamon and marshmallow fingers, page seventeen. Granny looked it up. And, uh, celery astonishment, page ten. Granny looked that up too. Can't say it astonished me, she said. And, uh, well, more or less, all of humorous puddings and cake decoration.、Uh, that's all of chapter six. I've done illustrations for that. Granny turned to chapter six. She had to turn the book around a couple of times. What one are you looking at? said Nanny Og, because an author is always keen to get feedback. Strawberry wobbler, said Granny. Oh, that one always gets a laugh. It did not appear to be obtaining one from Granny. She carefully closed the book. Githa, she said, this is me asking you this. Is there any page in this book? Is there any single recipe? Which does not, in some way, relate to <clears throat> goings on. Nanny Og, her face red as apples, seemed to give this some lengthy consideration. Porridge, she said eventually. Really? Yes. Er,、uh, no. I tell a lie. It's got my special honey mixture in it. Granny turned a page. What about this one? Maids of Honor. Well, they starts out as maids of honor, said Nanny, fidgeting with her feet, but they ends up tarts. Granny looked at the front cover again. The joy of snacks, and you actually set out. Well, it's just sort of.
turned out that way, really. Granny Weatherwax was not a jouster in the lists of love, but as an intelligent onlooker she knew how the game was played. No wonder the book had sold like hotcakes. Half the recipes told you how to make them. It was surprising the pages hadn't singed. And it was by a Lancre witch. The world was, Granny Weatherwax modestly admitted, well aware of who THE witch of Lancre was, viz, it was her. Githa Og, she said. Yes, Esme. Githa Og, you look me in the eye. Sorry, Esme. A Lankra witch, it says here. I never thought, Esme. So you'll go and see Mr Goatburger and have this stopped, right? I don't want people looking at me and thinking about the banana-nana soup surprise. I don't even believe the banana-nana soup surprise. And I ain't relishing going down the street and hearing people making cracks about bananas. Yes, says me. And I'll come with you to make sure you do. Yes, says me. And we'll talk to the man about your money. Yes, says me. And we might just drop in on young Agnes to make sure she's all right. Yes, says me. And we'll do it diplomatic-like. We don't want people thinking we're poking our noses in. Yes, says me. No one could say I interfere when I'm not wanted. You won't find anyone calling me a busybody. Yes, says me. That was, yes, says me, you won't find anyone calling you a busybody, was it? Oh, yes, says me. You sure about that? Yes, says me. Good. Granny looked out at the dull grey sky and the dying leaves, and felt, amazingly enough, her sap rising. A day ago the future had looked aching and desolate, and now it looked full of surprises and terror and bad things happening to people. If she had anything to do with it, anyway. In the scullery, Nanny Og grinned to herself. Agnes had known a little bit about the theatre. A travelling company came to Lancre sometimes. Their stage was about twice the size of a door, and backstage consisted of a bit of sacking behind which was usually a man trying to change trousers and wigs at the same time, and another man dressed as a king having a surreptitious smoke. The opera house was almost as big as the patrician's palace and far more palatial. It covered three acres. There was stabling for twenty horses and two elephants in the cellar. Agnes spent some time there because the elephants were reassuringly larger than her. There were rooms behind the stage so big that entire sets were stored there. There was a whole ballet school somewhere in the building. Some of the girls were on stage now, ugly in woolly jumpers, going through a routine. The inside of the opera house, at least the backstage inside, put Agnes strongly in mind of the clock her brother had taken apart to find the tick. It was hardly a building, it was more like a machine. Sets and curtains and ropes hung in the darkness like dreadful things in a forgotten cellar. The stage was only a small part of the place, a little rectangle of light in a huge, complicated darkness full of significant machinery. A piece of dust floated down from the blackness high above. She brushed it off. I thought I heard someone up there, she said. It's probably the ghost, said Christine. We've got one, you know. Oh, I said we. Oh, isn't this exciting? A man with his face covered by a white mask, said Agnes. Oh, you've heard about him then? What? Who? The ghost. Blast, thought Agnes. It was always ready to catch her out, just when she thought she'd put all that behind her. She'd know things without quite knowing why. It upset people. It certainly upset her. Oh, I suppose someone must have told me, she mumbled. He moves around the opera house invisibly, they say. One moment he'll be in the gods, the next moment he'll be backstage somewhere. No one knows how he does it. Really? They say he watches every performance. That's why they never sell tickets for Box 8. Didn't you know? Box 8, said Agnes. What's a box? Boxes! You know, that's where you get the best people. Look, I shall show you. Christine marched to the front of the stage and waved a hand grandly at the empty auditorium. The boxes, she said, over there and right up there. The gods. Her voice bounced back from the distant wall. Aren't the best people in the gods? Sounds... Oh, no. The best people will be in the boxes or possibly in the stalls. Agnes pointed. Who's down there? They must get a good view. Don't be silly. That's the pit. That's for the musicians. Well, that makes sense anyway. Uh, which one's box eight? 
I don't know. But they say if ever they sell seats in box eight, there'll be a dreadful tragedy. Isn't that romantic? For some reason, Agnes's practical eye was drawn to the huge chandelier that hung over the auditorium like a fantastic sea monster. Its thick rope disappeared into the darkness near the ceiling. The glass chimes tinkled. Another flare of that certain power which Agnes did her best to suppress at every turn flashed a treacherous image across her mind. That looks like an accident waiting to happen. If ever I saw one, she mumbled. I'm sure it's perfectly safe. Trilled Christine. I'm sure they wouldn't allow. A chord rolled out, shaking the stage. The chandelier tinkled, and more dust came down. What was that? Said Agnes. It was the organ. It's so big. It's behind the stage. Come on, let's go and see. Other members of the staff were hurrying towards the organ. There was an overturned bucket nearby and a spreading pool of green paint. A carpenter reached past Agnes and picked up an envelope that was lying on the organ seat. Oof for the boss, he said. When it's by mail, the postman usually just knocks, said a ballerina and giggled. Agnes looked up. Ropes swung lazily in the musty darkness. For a moment, she thought she saw a flash of white, and then it was gone. There was a shape just visible, tangled in the ropes. Something wet and sticky dripped down and splashed on the keyboard. People were already screaming when Agnes reached past, dipped her finger in the growing puddle, and sniffed. "It's blood," said the carpenter. "It's blood, isn't it?" said a musician. "Blood!" screamed Christine. "Blood!" It was Agnes's terrible fate to keep her head in a crisis. She sniffed her finger again. "It's turpentine," said Agnes. "Er,、uh, sorry, is that wrong?" Up in the tangle of ropes, the figure moaned. "Shouldn't we get him down?" she added. Kandu Cutoff was a humble woodcutter. He wasn't humble because he was a woodcutter. He would still have been quite humble if he'd owned five logging mills. He was just naturally humble. And he was unpretentiously stacking some logs at the point where the Lancre Road met the main mountain road, when he saw a farm cart rumble to a halt and unload two elderly ladies in black. Both carried a broomstick in one hand and a sack in the other. They were arguing. It was not a raised voice argument, but a chronic wrangle that had clearly been going on for some time and was set in for the rest of the decade. It's all very well for you, but it's my three dollars, so I don't see why I can't say how we go. I likes flying, and I'm telling you, it's too draughty on broomsticks this time of year, Esme. The breeze gets into places I wouldn't dream of talking about. Really? Can't imagine where those'd be then. Oh, Esme, don't owe Esme me. It weren't me that come up with the amusing wedding trifle with the special sponge fingers. Anyway, Grebo don't like it on the broomstick. He's got a delicate stomach. Cut off. Noticed that one of the sacks was moving in a lazy way. Gifford, I've seen him eat half a skunk, so don't tell me about his delicate stomach," said Granny, who disliked cats on principle. Anyway, he's been doing it again. Nanny Og waved her hands airily. Oh, he only does it sometimes when he's really in a corner," she said. He did it in old Mrs. Grope's hen house last week. She went in to see what all the ruckus was, and he did it right in front of her. She had to have a lie down. He was probably more frightened than she was," said Nanny defensively. "That's what comes of getting strange ideas in foreign parts," said Granny. "Now you've got a cat who, yes, what is it?" Cut off had meekly approached them and was hovering in the kind of half crouch of someone trying to be noticed while also not wanting to intrude. "Are you ladies waiting for the stagecoach?" "Yes," said the taller of the ladies. "Um, I'm afraid the next coach doesn't stop here." It doesn't stop until Creel Springs. They gave him a couple of polite stares. Thank you," said the tall one. She turned to her companion. It gave her a nasty shock, anyway. I dread to think what he'll learn this time. He pines when I'm gone. He won't take food from anyone else. Only 'cause they try to poison him, and no wonder. Cut off shook his head sadly and wandered back to his log pile. The coach turned up five minutes later, coming round the corner at speed. It drew level with the women, and stopped. That is, the horses tried to stand still, and the wheels locked. It wasn't so much a skid as a spin, and the whole thing gradually came to rest about fifty yards down the road, with the driver in a tree. The women strolled towards it, still arguing. 
One of them pokes the driver with her broomstick. Two tickets to Unc Moorpork, please. He landed in the road. Well, what do you mean, two tickets to Unc Moorpork? The coach doesn't stop here. Looks stopped to me. Did you do something? What, us? Listen, lady, even if I was stopping here, the tickets are forty damn dollars each. Oh. Why have you got broomsticks? shouted the driver. Are you witches? Yes. Have you got any special low terms for witches? Yeah. How about meddling interfering old baggages? Cutoff felt that he must have missed part of the conversation because the next exchange went like this. What was that again, young man? Two complimentary tickets to Ark Moor Pork, ma'am. No problem. Inside seats, mind. No travelling on the top. Certainly, ma'am. Excuse me while I just kneel in the dirt so you can step up, ma'am. Cutoff nodded happily to himself as the coach pulled away again. It was nice to see that good manners and courtesy were still alive. With great difficulty and much shouting and untangling of ropes far above, the figure was lowered to the stage. He was soaked in paint and turpentine. The swelling audience of off-duty staff and rehearsal truants crowded in around him. Agnes knelt down, loosened his collar, and tried to unwind the rope that had caught around arm and neck. Does anyone know him? she said. It's Tommy Cripps, said a musician. He paints scenery. Tommy moaned and opened his eyes. Oh, oh, I saw him, he muttered. It was horrible. Saw what? said Agnes. And then she had a sudden feeling that she'd intruded on some private conversation. Around her... There was a babble of voices. Giselle said she saw him last week. He's here. It's happening again. Are we all doomed? Squeaked Christine. Tommy Cripps gripped Agnes's arm. He's got a face like death. Who? The ghost. What ghost? It's white bone. He has no nose. A couple of ballet dancers fainted, but carefully, so as not to get their clothes dirty. Then how does he... Agnes began. I saw him too. On cue, the company turned. An elderly man advanced across the stage. He wore an ancient opera hat and carried a sack over one shoulder, while his spare hand made the needlessly expansive gestures of someone who has got hold of some direful information and can't wait to freeze all nearby spines. The sack must have contained something alive because it was bouncing around. I saw him, oh yes, with his great black cloak and his white face with no eyes, but only two holes where eyes should be. Oh, and... He had a mask on, said Agnes. The old man paused and shot her the dark look reserved for all those who insist on injecting a note of sanity when things are getting interestingly ghastly. And he had no nose, he went on, ignoring her. I just said that, muttered Tommy Cripps in a rather annoyed voice. I told them that. They already know that. If he had no nose, how did he sm... Agnes began, but no one was listening to her. Did you mention about the eyes, said the old man. I was just getting round to the eyes, snapped Tommy. Yes, he had eyes like... Are we talking about some kind of mask here? said Agnes. Now everyone was giving her that kind of look UFOologists get when they suddenly say, Hey, if you shade your eyes, you can see it is just a flock of geese after all. The man with the sack coughed and regrouped. Like great holes they were, he began, but it was clear that it had all been spoiled for him. Great holes, he said sourly. That's what I saw. And no nose, I might add. Thank you so very much. It's the ghost again, said a scene shifter. He jumped out from behind the organ, said Tommy Cripps. Next thing I knew, there was a rope around me neck, and I was upside down. The company looked at the man with the sack, in case he could trump this. Great black holes, he managed, sticking to what he knew. All right, everyone, what's going on here? An imposing figure strode out of the wings. He had flowing black hair, carefully brushed to give it a carefree, alfresco look. But the face underneath was the face of an organiser. 
He nodded at the old man with the sack. What are you staring at, Mr. Pounder? he said. The old man looks down. I knows what I saw, Mr. Salzella, he said. I see lots of things I do. As much as is visible through the bottom of a bottle, I have no doubt, you old reprobate. What happened to Tommy? It was the ghost, said Tommy, delighted to have centre stage again. He swooped out at me, Mr. Salzella. I think my leg is broken, he added quickly, in the voice of one who is suddenly aware of the time-off opportunities of the situation. Agnes expected the newcomer to say something like, Ghosts, there's no such thing. He had the kind of face that said that. Instead, he said, Back again, is he? Where did he go? Didn't see, Mr. Salzella. He just swooped off again. Some of you help Tommy down to the canteen, said Salzella, and someone else fetch a doctor. His leg isn't broken, said Agnes, but that's a nasty rope burn on his neck and he's filled his own ear with paint. What do you know about it, miss? said Tommy. A paint-filled ear didn't sound as though it had the possibilities of a broken leg. I've, er, uh, had some training, said Agnes, and then added quickly, It's a nasty bird, though, and of course there may be some delayed shock. Oh, brandy is very good for that, isn't it? said Tommy. Perhaps you could try forcing some between my lips. Thank you, Perdita. The rest of you go back to what you were doing, said Salzella. Big, dark holes, said Mr. Pounder. Big ones. Yes, thank you, Mr. Pounder. Help Ron with Mr. Cripps, will you? Perdita, you come here. And you, Christine? The two girls stood before the director of music. Did you see anything? said Salzella. I saw a great creature with great flapping wings and great big holes where his eyes should be, said Christine. I'm afraid I just saw something white up in the ceiling, said Agnes. Sorry. She blushed, aware of how useless that sounded. Perdita would have seen a mysterious cloaked figure or something. Something interesting. Salzella smiled at her. You mean you just see things that are really there, she said. I can see you haven't been with the opera for long, dear, but I may say I'm pleased to have a level-headed person around here for once. Oh, no! screamed someone. It's the ghost, shrieked Christine automatically. Uh, it's the young man behind the organ, said Agnes. Sorry. Observant as well as level-headed, said Salzella, whereas I can see that you, Christine, will fit right in here. What's the matter, André? A fair-haired young man peered around the organ pipes. Someone's been smashing things, Mr. Salzella, he said mournfully. The pallet springs and the back falls and everything. Completely ruined. I'm sure I won't be able to get a tune out of it. And it's priceless. Salzella sighed. All right, I'll tell Mr. Bucket, he said. Thank you, everyone. He gave Agnes a gloomy nod and strode off. You shouldn't ought to do that to people, said Nanny Og in a vague sort of way as the coach began to get up speed. She looked around with a wide, friendly grin at the now rather dishevelled occupants of the coach. Morning, she said, delving into the sack. I'm Githa Og, I've got fifteen children, this is my friend Desmi Weatherwax. We're going to Ankh Morpork, would anyone like an egg sandwich? I've brung plenty, the cat's been sleeping on them, but they're fine. Look, they bend back all right. No? Please yourself, I'm sure. Let's see what else we've got. Ah, has anybody got an opener for a bottle of beer? A man in the corner indicated that he might have such a thing. Fine, said Nanny Og. Anyone got something to drink a bottle of beer out of? Another man nodded, hopefully. Good, said Nanny Og. Now, has anybody got a bottle of beer? Granny, for once not the centre of attention, as all horrified eyes were on Nanny and her sack, surveyed the other occupants of the coach. The express stage went right over the ram tops and all the way through the patchwork of little countries beyond. If it cost forty dollars just from Lankra, then it must have cost these people a lot more. What sort of folk spent the best part of two months' wages just to travel fast and uncomfortably? The thin man who sat clutching his bag was probably a spy, she decided. The fat man who'd volunteered the glass looked as if he sold things. He had the unpleasant complexion of someone who'd hit too many bottles but missed too many meals. They were huddled together on their seat because the rest of it was occupied by a man of almost wizardly proportions. He didn't appear to have woken up when the coach stopped. There was a handkerchief over his face. 
He was snoring with the regularity of a geezer and looked as though the only worries he might have in the world were a tendency for small objects to gravitate towards him and the occasional tide. Nanny Og continued to rummage round in her bag and as was the case when she was preoccupied, her mouth had wired itself to her eyeballs without her brain intervening. She was used to travelling by broomstick. Long-distance ground travel was a novelty to her, so she prepared with some care. Ah, let's see now. Book of puzzles for long journeys. Cushion. Foot powder. <laughs> Mosquito trap. Phrase book. Bag to be sick in two. Oh, dear. The audience which against all probability had managed to squeeze itself further away from Nanny during the litany, waited with horrified interest. What? said Granny. How often do you reckon this coach stops? What's the matter? I should have gone before we left. Sorry, it's the jolting. Anyone know if there's a privy on this thing? she added brightly. Um, said the probable spy, we generally wait until the next stop, or... He stopped. He had been about to add, there's always the window which was a manly option on the bumpier rural stretches, but he stopped himself in the horrible apprehension that this ghastly old woman might seriously consider the possibility. There's O'Hoolan just a bit further on the road, said Granny, who was trying to doze. You just wait. This coach doesn't stop at O'Hoolan, said the spy helpfully. Granny Weatherwax raised her head. Up until now, that is, said the spy. Mr. Bucket was sitting in his office trying to make sense of the Opera House's books. They didn't make any kind of sense. He reckoned he was as good as the next man at reading a balance sheet, but these were to bookkeeping what grit was to clockwork. Seldom Bucket had always enjoyed opera. He didn't understand it and never had, but he didn't understand the ocean either, and he enjoyed that too. He looked upon the purchase as, well, something to do, a sort of working retirement. The offer had been too good to pass up. Things had been getting pretty tough in the wholesale cheese and milk derivatives business, and he'd been looking forward to the quieter climes of the world of art. The previous owners had put on some good operas. It was only a shame that their genius hadn't run to bookkeeping as well. Money seemed to have been taken out of the accounts when anyone needed it. The financial record system largely consisted of notes on torn bits of paper saying, I've taken $30 to pay Q. See you Monday, R. Who was R? Who was Q? What was the money for? You wouldn't get away with this sort of thing in the world of cheese. He looked up as the door opened. Ah, Salzella, he said. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, you, you, you don't know who uh, Q is by any chance? No, Mr. Bucket. Or R. I'm afraid not. Salzella pulled up a chair. It's taken me all morning, but I, I've worked out we pay more than $1,500 a year for ballet shoes, said Bucket, waving a piece of paper in the air. Salzella nodded. Yes, they do rather go through them at the toes. I mean, it's ridiculous. I, I've still got a pair of boots belonging to my father. But ballet shoes, <clears throat> sir, are rather more like foot gloves, Salzella explained. You're telling me. They cost seven dollars a pair, and they last hardly any time at all. Uh, a few performances. There must be some way we can, we can make a saving. Salzella gave his new employer a long, cool stare. Possibly we could ask the girls to spend more time in the air, he said. A few extra grand jetés. Bucket looked puzzled. Hmm, w uh, w would that work, he said suspiciously. Well, their feet wouldn't be on the ground for so long, would they, said Salzella, in the tones of one who knows for a fact that he's much more intelligent than anyone else in the room. Oh, good point, good point. Um, have a word with the ballet mistress, will you? Of course. I am sure she will welcome the suggestion. You may well have halved costs at a stroke. Bucket beamed. Which is perhaps just as well, said Salzella. There is, in fact, another matter that I've come to see you about. Yes? It is to do with the organ we had. Had? Uh, what do you mean, had? said Bucket, adding, You're going to tell me something expensive, are you? What have we got now? A lot of pipes and some keyboards, said Salzella. Everything else has been smashed. Smashed? By who? Salzella leaned back. He was not a man to whom amusement came easily, but he realised that he was rather enjoying this. 
Tell me, he said, when Mr. Pnigeus and Mr. Cavalier sold you this opera house, did they mention anything... Hmm, supernatural? Bucket scratched his head. Uh, well, uh, well, yes. After I'd signed and paid, it was a bit of a joke. They said, uh, oh, and by the way, people say there's some man in evening dress who haunts the place. Ha, ha, ha. Ridiculous, isn't it? These theatrical people like children, really. Ha, ha, ha. But you may find it keeps them happy if you always keep box eight free on first nights. Ha, ha, ha. I remember that quite well. Handing over thirty thousand dollars concentrates the memory a bit. And then they rode off. Quite a fast carriage, now I come to think about it. Ah, said Salzella, and he almost smiled. Well, now that the ink is dry, I wonder if I might fill you in on the fine detail. Birds sang. The wind rattled the dried seed heads of moorland flowers. Granny Weatherwax poked in the ditches to see if there were any interesting herbs hereabouts. High over the hills a buzzard screamed and wheeled. The coach stood by the side of the road, despite the fact that it should have been speeding along at least twenty miles away. At last Granny grew bored and sidled towards a clump of gorse bushes. How are you doing, Githa? Fine, fine, said a muffled voice. Only I reckon the coach driver is getting a bit impatient. You can't hurry, nature, said Nanny Og. Well, don't blame me. You was the one who said it was too draughty on the broomsticks. You make yourself useful, Esme Weatherwax, said the voice from the bushes, by obliging me and finding any dock or burdock plants that might happen to be around here. Thank you very much. Herbs? What are you planning with them? I'm planning to say, thank goodness, big leaves, that's just what I need. Some distance from the bushes where Nanny Og was communing with nature, there was, placid under the autumn sky, a lake. In the reeds, a swan was dying, or was due to die. There was, however, an unforeseen snag. Death sat down on the bank. Now look, he said, I know how it is supposed to go. Swans sing just once, beautifully, before they die. That's where the word swan song originates. It is very moving. Now, let us try this again. He produced a tuning fork from the shadowy recesses of his robe and twanged it on the side of his scythe. There's your note. Uh-uh, said the swan, shaking its head. Why make it difficult? I like it here, said the swan. That has nothing to do with it. Did you know I could break a man's arm with a blow of my wing? How about if I get you started? Do you know Moonlight Bay? That's no more than a barbershop ditty. I happen to be a swan. Little brown jog? Death cleared his throat. Ha, ha, ha. He, he, he. Little brown... That's a song? The swan hissed angrily and swayed from one crabbed foot to the other. I don't know who you are, Sirrah, but where I come from, we've got better taste in music. Really? Would you care to show me an example? Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Damn. Thought you'd got me there, didn't you? Said the swan. Thought you'd tricked me, hmm? Thought I might unthinkingly give you a couple of bars of the peddler's song from Lohenshark, eh? I don't know that one. The swan took a deep laboured breath. That's the one that goes, Schneider, mine and Nigen has... Thank you, said Death. The scythe moved. Bugger! A moment later, the swan stepped out of its body and ruffled fresh but slightly transparent wings. Now what? it said. That's up to you. It's always up to you. Mr. Bucket leaned back in his creaky leather chair with his eyes shut until his director of music had finished. So, Bucket said, let me see if I've got this right. There's this ghost. Every time anyone loses a hammer in this place, it's been stolen by the ghost. Every time someone cracks a note, it's because of the ghost. But also, every time someone finds a lost object, it's because of the ghost. Every time someone has a very good scene, it must be because of the ghost. He sort of 
comes with the building, like the rats. Every so often someone sees him, but not for long, because he comes and goes like a, well, well, well <laughs> a ghost. Apparently, we let him use Box 8 for free on every first night performance. And you say people like him. Like isn't quite the right word, said Salzella. It would be more correct to say that, well, it's pure superstition, of course, but they think he's lucky. Thought he was, anyway. And you wouldn't understand a thing about that, would you, you coarse little cheese monger? he added to himself. Cheese is cheese. Milk goes rotten naturally. You don't have to make it happen by having several hundred people wound up until their nerves go twang. Lucky, said Bucket flatly. Luck is very important, said Salzella, in a voice in which pained patience floated like ice cubes. I imagine that temperament is not an important factor in the cheese business? We rely on rennet, said Bucket. Salzella sighed. Anyway, the company feel that the ghost is mm, lucky. He used to send people little notes of encouragement. After a really good performance, the sopranos would find a box of chocolates in their dressing room. Mm, that sort of thing. And dead flowers, for some reason. Dead flowers? Well, not flowers at all as such, just a bouquet of dead rose stems with no roses on them. It's something of a trademark of his. It's considered lucky. Dead flowers are lucky. Possibly. Live flowers certainly are terribly bad luck on stage. Some singers won't even have them in their dressing room. So, dead flowers are safe, you might say. Odd, but safe. And it didn't worry people because everyone thought the ghost was on their side. At least they did, until about six months ago. End of side three. Side four. Mr. Bucket shut his eyes again. Tell me, he said. There have been accidents. What kind of accidents? The kind of accidents that you prefer to call accidents? Mr. Bucket's eyes stayed closed. Like the uh, time when Reg Plenty and Fred Chiswell were working late one night up on the curdling vats, and it turned out Reg had been seeing Fred's wife, and somehow, Bucket swallowed, somehow he must have tripped, Fred said, and, and, and fallen. I am not familiar with the gentleman concerned, but that kind of accident, yes. Bucket sighed. That was some of the finest farmhouse nutty we ever made. Do you want me to tell you about our accidents? I'm sure you're going to. A seamstress stitched herself to the wall. A deputy stage manager was found stabbed with a prop sword. Oh, and you wouldn't like me to tell you what happened to the man who worked the trap door. And all the lead mysteriously disappeared from the roof, although personally I don't think that was the work of the ghost. And everyone calls these accidents. Well, you wanted to sell your cheese, didn't you? I can't imagine anything that would depress the house like news that dead bodies are dropping like flies out of the flies. He took an envelope out of his pocket and placed it on the table. The ghost likes to leave little messages, he said. There was one by the organ. A scenery painter spotted him and nearly had an accident. Bucket sniffed the envelope. It reeked of turpentine. The letter inside was on a sheet of the Opera House's own notepaper. In neat, copperplate writing, it said, Ah-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha. Ah-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha. Ah-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha. Beware. Yours sincerely, the Opera Ghost. What sort of person, said Salzella patiently, sits down and writes a maniacal laugh? And all those exclamation marks, you notice? Five, a sure sign of someone who wears his underpants on his head. Opera can do that to a man. Look, at least let's search the building. The cellars go on forever. I'll need a boat. A boat? In the cellar? Oh, 
Didn't they tell you about the sub-basement? Bucket smiled the bright, crazed smile of a man who was nearing double exclamation marks himself. Didn't know, he said. They didn't tell me about the uh, sub-basement. They were too busy not telling me that someone goes around killing the company. <laughs> I don't recall anyone saying, Oh, by the way, people are dying a lot and incidentally there's a touch of rising damp. They're flooded. Oh, good, said Bucket. What with? Buckets of blood? <laughs> didn't you have a look? Uh, they said the cellars were fine. And you believed them? Well, there was rather a lot of champagne. Salzella sighed. Bucket took offence at the sigh. I happen to pride myself that I am a good judge of character, he said. Look a man deeply in the eye and give him a firm handshake. And you know everything about him. Yes, indeed, said Salzella. Oh, Blast. Signor Enrico Basilica will be here the day after tomorrow. Uh, do you think something might happen to him? Oh, not much. Cut throat, perhaps? What? You think so? How should I know? Well, what do you want me to do? Close the place? As far as I can see, it doesn't make any money as it is. Why hasn't anyone told the watch? That would be worse, said Salzella. Big trolls in rusty chainmail tramping everywhere, getting in everyone's way and asking stupid questions. They'd close us down. Bucket swallowed. Oh, we can't have that, he said. Can't have them putting everyone on edge. Salzella sat back. He seemed to relax a little. On edge, Mr. Bucket, he said. This is opera. <laughs> everyone is always on edge. Have you ever heard of a catastrophe curve, Mr. Bucket? Seldom Bucket did his best. Well, well I, I know there's a dreadful bend in the road, but a catastrophe curve, Mr. Bucket, is what opera runs along. Opera happens because a large number of things amazingly fail to go wrong, Mr. Bucket. It works because of hatred and love and nerves. All the time. This isn't cheese. This is opera. If you wanted a quiet retirement, Mr. Bucket, you shouldn't have bought the opera house. You should have done something peaceful, like alligator dentistry. Nanny Og was easily bored, but on the other hand, she was also easy to amuse. Certainly an interesting way to travel, she said. You do get to see places. Yes, said Granny, every five miles, it seems to me. Oh, I can't think what's got into me. I shouldn't think the horses have managed to get faster and a walk all morning. They were by now alone, except for the huge snoring man. The other two had got out and joined the travellers on top. The main cause of this was Grebo. With a cat's unerring instinct for people who dislike cats, he leapt heavily into their laps and given them the young massa back on the old plantation treatment and he treedled them into submission, and then settled down and gone to sleep, claws gripping not sufficiently to draw blood, but definitely to suggest that this was an option should the person move or breathe. And then, when he was sure they were resigned to the situation, he'd started to smell. No one knew where it came from. It was not associated with any known orifice. It was just that after five minutes' doze, the air above Grebo had a penetrating smell of fermented carpets. He was now trying it out on the very large man. It wasn't working. At last, Grebo had found a stomach too big for him. Also, the continuing going up and down was beginning to make him feel ill. The snores reverberated around the coach. Wouldn't like to come between him and his pudding, said Nanny Og. Granny was staring out of the window. At least her face was turned that way, but her eyes were focused on infinity. Get up. Yes, Esme. Mind if I ask you a question? You don't normally ask if I mind, said Nanny. Doesn't it ever get you down the way people don't think properly? Uh-oh, thought Nanny. I reckon I got her out just in time. Thank goodness for literature. How do you mean, she said. I means the way they distract themselves. Can't say I ever really thought about it, Esme. Like, suppose I was to say to you, Githa Og, your house is on fire. What's the first thing you'd try and take out? Nanny bit her lip. This is one of them personality questions, ain't it? She said. That's right. Like you try and guess what I'm like by what I say. 
Geeker Og, I've known you all my life. I knows what you're like. I don't need to guess. But answer me all the same. I reckon I'd take Grebo. Granny nodded. Cause that shows I've got a warm and considerate nature. Nanny went on. No, it shows you're the kind of person who tries to work out what the right answer's supposed to be, said Granny. Untrustworthy. That was a witchy's answer if ever I heard one. Devious. Nanny looked proud. The snores changed to a blurt, blurt noise, and the handkerchief quivered. It's a treacle pudding with lots of custard. Hey, he just said something, said Nanny. He talks in his sleep, said Granny Weatherwax. He's been doing it on and off. I never heard him. You were out of the coach. Oh. At the last stop, he was going on about pancakes with lemon, said Granny, and mashed potatoes with butter. Makes me feel hungry just listening to that, said Nanny. I've got a pork pie in the bag somewhere. The snoring stopped abruptly. A hand came up and moved the handkerchief aside. The face beyond was friendly, bearded, and small. It gave the witches a shy smile, which turned inexorably towards the pork pie. Uh, want a slice, Mister? said Nanny. I've got some mustard here too. Oh, <laughs> uh, would you, dear lady? said the man in a squeaky voice. Don't know when I last had a pork pie. Oh, oh dear! He grimaced as if he'd just said something wrong, and then relaxed. Got a bottle of beer if you want to drop too," said Nanny. She was one of those women who enjoy seeing people eat almost as much as eating herself. Oh, beer," said the man. "Beer? You know they don't let me drink beer. <laughs> it's supposed to be the wrong ambience. <laughs> I'd give anything for a pint of beer." Just a thank you would do," said Nanny, passing it over. "Who's this they to whom you refers?" said Granny. "It's my fault, really," said the man through a faint spray of pork crumbs. "Got caught up, I suppose." There was a change in the sounds from outside. The lights of a town were going past, and the coach was slowing down. The man forced the last of the pie into his mouth and washed it down with the dregs of the beer. "Oh, lovely," he said. Then he leaned back and put the handkerchief over his face. He raised a corner. "Don't tell anyone I spoke to you," he said. "But you've made a friend of Henry Slug." "Then what do you do, Henry Slug?" said Granny carefully. "I'm." <laughs> I'm on the stage. Yes, we can see," said Nanny Og. "No, I meant." The coach stopped. Gravel crunched as people climbed down. The door was pulled open. Granny saw a crowd of people peering excitedly through the doorway and reached up automatically to straighten her hat. But several hands reached out for Henry Slug, who sat up, smiled nervously, and let himself be helped out. Several people also shouted out a name. But it wasn't the name of Henry Slug. Who's Henry Cor Basilica? Said Nanny Og. Don't know. Said Granny. Maybe he's the person Mister Slug's afraid of. The coaching inn was a run-down shack with only two bedrooms for guests. As helpless old ladies travelling alone, the witches got one simply because all hell would have been let loose if they hadn't. Mister Bucket looked pained. Uh, I may just be a big man in cheese to you," he said. "You may think I'm just some hard-headed businessman who wouldn't know culture if he found it floating in his tea, but I have been a patron of the opera here and elsewhere for 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 many years. I can hum nearly the whole of. I am sure you've seen a lot of opera," said Salzella. "But how much do you know about production? I've been behind the scenes in lots of theatres." Oh, theater," said Salzella. "Theater doesn't even approach it. Opera isn't theater with singing and dancing. Operas, opera. You might think a production like Lou and Shark is full of passion, but it's a sandpit of toddlers compared to what goes on behind the scenes. The singers all loathe the sight of one another. The chorus despises the singers. They both hate the orchestra, and everyone fears the conductor." The staff on one prompt side won't talk to the staff on the opposite prompt side. The dancers are all crazed from hunger in any case, and that's only the start of it. Because what is really? There was a series of knocks at the door. They were painfully irregular, as if the knocker were having to concentrate quite hard. Come in, Walter," said Salzella. Walter Plinge shuffled in, a pail dangling at the end of each arm. 
Come to fill your coal scuttle, Mr. Bucket. Bucket waved a hand vaguely and turned back to the director of music. You were saying? Salzella stared at Walter as the man carefully piled lumps of coal in the scuttle one at a time. Salzella? What? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what was I saying? Uh, something about it being only the start. What? Oh, yes, yes. You see, it's fine for actors. There's plenty of parts for old men. Acting something you can do all your life. You get better at it. But when your talent is singing or dancing, time creeps up behind you. All the... He fumbled for a word and settled lamely for... Time. Time is the poison. You watch backstage one night and you'll see the dancers checking all the time in any mirror they can find for that first little imperfection. You watch the singers. Everyone's on edge. Everyone knows that this might be their last perfect night. That tomorrow might be the beginning of the end. That's why everyone worries about luck, you see. All the stuff about live flowers being unlucky, you remember? Well, so's green. And real jewellery worn on stage. And real mirrors on stage. And whistling on stage. And peeking at the audience through the main curtains. And using new makeup on a first night. And knitting on stage, even at rehearsals. A yellow clarinet in the orchestra is very unlucky. Don't ask me why. And as for stopping a performance before its proper ending, well, that's the worst of all. You might as well sit under a ladder and break mirrors. Behind Salzella, Walter carefully placed the last lump of coal on the pile in the scuttle and dusted it carefully. Good grief, said Bucket at last. I thought it was tough in cheese. He waved a hand at the pile of papers and what passed for the accounts. I paid thirty thousand for this place, he said. It's in the centre of the city. Prime sight. I thought it was hard bargaining. They'd have probably accepted twenty-five. Uh, and, and, and tell me again about Box 8. You let this ghost have it. The ghost considers it his for every first night, yes. Mm. How does he get in? No one knows. We've searched and searched for secret entrances. He, he really doesn't pay? No. It's worth fifty dollars a night. There will be trouble if you sell it, said Salzella. Good grief, Salzella, you're an educated man. How can you sit there so calmly and accept this sort of madness? Some creature in a mask has the run of the place, gets a prime box all to himself, kills people, and you sit there saying there will be trouble. I told you, the show must go on. Why? We never said... The cheese must go on. What's so special about the show going on? Salzella smiled. As far as I understand it, he said, the power behind the show, the soul of the show, all the effort that's gone into it, call it what you will, it leaks out and spills everywhere. That's why they burble about the show must go on. It must go on. But most of the company wouldn't even understand why anyone should ask the question. Bucket glared at the pile of what passed for the Opera House's financial records. Well, they certainly don't understand bookkeeping. Who does the accounts? All of us, really, said Salzella. All of you? Money gets put in, money gets taken out, said Salzella vaguely. Is it important? Bucket's jaw dropped. I is it important? Because, Salzella went on smoothly, Opera doesn't make money. Opera never makes money. Good grief, man! Important? What had I ever have achieved in the cheese business? I'd like to know if I'd said that money wasn't important. Salzella smiled humorlessly. There are people out on the stage right now, sir, he said, who'd say that you would probably have made better cheeses. He sighed and leaned over the desk. You see, he said... Cheese does make money, and opera doesn't. 
Opera's what you spend money on. But what do you get out of it? You get opera. You put money in, you see, and opera comes out," said Salzella wearily. "There's no profit." Profit, profit. Murmured the director of music, scratching his forehead. No, I don't believe I've come across the word. Then, <laughs> how do we manage? We seem to rub along. Bucket put his head in his hands. I mean, he muttered half to himself. I knew the place wasn't making much, but I thought that was just because it was run badly. We, we have big audiences. We charge a mint for tickets. Now I'm told that a ghost runs around killing people. And we don't even make any money. Salzella beamed. Ah, opera, he said. Grebo stalked over the inn's rooftops. Most cats are nervous and ill at ease when taken out of their territory, which is why cat books go on about putting butter on their paws and so on. Presumably because constantly skidding into the walls will take an animal's mind off where the walls actually are. But Grebo travelled well. Purely because he took it for granted that the whole world was his dirt box, he dropped heavily onto an outhouse roof and padded towards a small open window. Grebo also had a cat's approach to possessions, which was simply that nothing edible had a right to belong to other people. From the window came a variety of smells, which included pork pies and cream. He squeezed through and dropped onto the pantry shelf. Of course, sometimes he got caught. At least sometimes he got discovered. There was cream. He settled down. He was halfway down the bowl when the door opened. Grebo's ears flattened. His one good eye sought desperately for an escape route. The window was too high. The person opening the door was wearing a long dress that militated against the old through the legs routine, and, and, and there was no escape. His claws scrabbled on the floor. Oh no! Here it came. Something flipped in his body's morphogenic field. Here was a problem a cat shape couldn't deal with. Oh well, we know another one. Crockery crashed around him. Shelves erupted as his head rose. A bag of flour exploded outwards to make room for his broadening shoulders. The cook stared up at him. Then she looked down, and then up, and then her gaze dragged as though it were on a winch down again. She screamed. Grebo screamed. He grabbed desperately at a bowl to cover that part which, as a cat, he had never had to worry about exposing. He screamed again this time because he just poured lukewarm pork dripping all over himself. His groping fingers found a large copper jelly mould. Clasping it to his groinal areas, he barreled forward and fled out of the pantry and out of the kitchen and out of the dining room and out of the inn and into the night. The spy, who was dining with the travelling salesman, put down his knife. That's something you don't often see," he said. "What?" said the salesman, who'd had his back to the excitement. "One of those old copper jelly molds. They're worth quite a lot now. My aunt had a very good one." The hysterical cook was given a big drink, and several members of staff went out into the darkness to investigate. All they found was a jelly mold lying forlornly in the yard. At home. Granny Weatherwax slept with open windows and an unlocked door, secure in the knowledge that the Ramtop's various creatures of the night would rather eat their own ears than break in. In dangerously civilized lands, however, she took a different view. I really don't think we need to shove the bed in front of the door, Esme," said Nanny Og, heaving on her end. "You can't be too careful," said Granny. "Supposing some man started rattling the knob in the middle of the night." "Oh, not at our time of life." Said Nanny sadly, "Giffa Og, you are the most." Granny was interrupted by a watery sound. It came from behind the wall, and went on for some time. It stopped and then started again. A steady splashing that gradually became a trickle. Nanny started to grin. "Someone filling a bath," said Granny. "Or I suppose it could be someone filling a bath," Nanny conceded. There was the sound of a third jug being emptied. Footsteps left the room. A few seconds later, a door opened, 
and there was a rather heavier tread, followed after a brief interval by a few splashes and a grunt. Yes, a man getting into a bath, said Granny. What are you doing, Githa? Seeing if there's a knot hole in this wood somewhere, said Nanny. Oh, here's one. Come back here. Oh, sorry, Esme. And then the singing started. It was a very pleasant tenor voice, given added timbre by the bath itself. Show me the way to go home. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. Someone's enjoying themselves anyway, said Nanny. Wherever I may roam. There was a knock at the distant bathroom door, upon which the singer slipped smoothly into another language. Per via di terra, mare o schiuma. The witches looked at one another. A muffled voice said, I brought you your hot water bottle, sir. I thank you very much, said the bather, his voice dripping with accent. Footsteps went away in the distance. Indicame la strada to go home. Um, splash, splash. Good evening, friends. Well, 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 said Granny, more or less to herself. It seems once again that our Mr. Slug is a secret polyglot. Fancy. And you haven't even looked through the knot hole, said Nanny. Githa, is there anything in the whole world you can't make sound grubby? Not found it yet, Esme, said Nanny brightly. I meant that when he mutters in his sleep and sings in his bath, he talks just like us. But when he thinks people are listening, he comes over all foreign. That's probably to throw that basilica person off the scent, Nanny said. Oh, I reckon Mr. Basilica is very close to Henry Slug, said Granny. In fact, I reckon that they're one and the same. There was a gentle knock at the door. Who's there? Granny demanded. Uh, it's me, ma'am. Mr. Slop. This is my tavern. The witches pushed the bed aside and Granny opened the door a fraction. Yes, she said suspiciously. Uh, the coachman said you were, um, witches. Yes. Maybe you could, um, help us. What's wrong? It's my boy. Granny opened the door further and saw the woman standing behind Mr. Slot. One look at her face was enough. There was a bundle in her arms. Granny stepped back. Bring him in and let me have a look at him. She took the baby from the woman, sat down on the room's one chair, and pulled back the blanket. Nanny Og peered over her shoulder. Hmm, said Granny, after a while. She glanced at Nanny, who gave an almost imperceptible shake of her head. There's a curse on this house, that's what it is, said Slot. My best cow's been taken mortally sick too. Oh, you have a cow shed, said Granny. Very good place for a sick room, a cow shed, it's the warmth. You better show me where it is. You want to take the boy down there? Right now. The man looked at his wife and shrugged. Well, I'm sure you know your business best, he said. It's this way. He led the witches down some back stairs and across a yard and into the fetid sweet air of the byre. A cow was stretched out on the straw. It rolled an eye madly as they entered and tried to moo. Granny took in the scene and stood looking thoughtful for a moment. Then she said, This will do. What do you need? said Slot. Just peace and quiet. The man scratched his head. I thought you did a chant or made up some potion or something, he said. Sometimes. I mean, I know where there's a toad. All I shall require is a candle, said Granny. A new one for preference. That's all? Yes. Mr. Slot looked a little put out. Despite his distraction, something about his manner suggested that Granny Weatherwax was possibly not that much of a witch if she didn't want a toad. And some matches, said Granny, noting this. A pack of cards might be useful too. And I'll need three cold lamb chops and exactly two pints of beer, said Nanny Og. The man nodded. This didn't sound too toad-like, but it was better than nothing. What do you ask for that for? hissed Granny as the man bustled off. Can't imagine what good those would do. Anyway, you already had a big dinner. Well, I'm always prepared to go that extra meal. You won't want me around, and I'll get bored said Nanny. Did I say I didn't want you around? Well, even I can see that boy is in a coma, and the cow has the red buggy, if I'm any judge. That's bad too, said
So I reckon you're planning some direct action. Granny shrugged. Time like that a witch needs to be alone, said Nanny. But you just mind what you're doing, Esme Weatherwax. The child was brought down in a blanket and made as comfortable as possible. The man followed behind his wife with a tray. Mrs. Og will do her necessary procedures with the tray in her room, said Granny haughtily. You just leave me in here tonight and no one is to come in, right? No matter what. The mother gave a worried curtsy. But I thought I might look in at about... No, no one. Now, off you go. When they'd been gently but firmly ushered out, Nanny Og stuck her head around the door. What exactly are you planning, Esme? You sat up with a dying often enough gither. Oh, yes, it's... Nanny's face fell. Oh, Esme, you're not going to enjoy your supper, gither. Granny closed the door. She spent some time arranging the boxes and barrels so that she had a crude table and something to sit on. The air was warm and smelled of bovine flatulence. Periodically, she checked the health of both patients, although there was little enough to check. In the distance, the sounds of the inn gradually subsided. The last one was the clink of the innkeeper's keys as he locked the doors. Granny heard him walk across to the cowshed door and hesitate. Then he went away and began to climb the stairs. She waited a little longer and then lit the candle. Its cheery flame gave the place a warm and comforting glow. On the plank table, she laid out the cards and attempted to play patience, a game she'd never been able to master. The candle burned down. She pushed the cards away and sat watching the flame. After some immeasurable piece of time, the flame flickered. It would have passed unnoticed by anyone who hadn't been concentrating on it for some while. She took a deep breath and... Good morning, said Granny Weatherwax. Good morning, said a voice by her ear. Nanny Og had long ago polished off the chops and the beer, but she hadn't got into bed. She lay on it, fully clothed, with her arms behind her head, staring at the dark ceiling. After a while there was a scratching on the shutters. She got up and opened them. A huge figure leapt into the room. For a moment the moonlight lit a glistening torso and a mane of black hair. Then the creature dived under the bed. Oh, dearie, dearie me, said Nanny. She waited for a while and then fished a chop bone off her tray. There was still a bit of meat on it. She lowered it towards the floor. A hand shot out and grabbed it. Nanny sat back. Poor little man, she said. It was only on the subject of Grebo that Nanny's otherwise keen sense of reality found itself all twisted. To Nanny Og he was merely a larger version of the little fluffy kitten he had once been. To everyone else he was a scarred ball of inventive malignancy. But now he had to deal with a problem seldom encountered by cats. The witches had a year ago turned him into a human for reasons that had seemed quite necessary at the time. It had taken a lot of effort, and his morphogenic field had reasserted itself after a few hours, much to everyone's relief. But magic is never as simple as people think. It has to obey certain universal laws, and one is that no matter how hard a thing is to do, once it has been done, it will become a whole lot easier, and will therefore be done a lot. A huge mountain might be scaled by strong men only after many centuries of failed attempts. But a few decades later, grandmothers will be strolling up it for tea and then wandering back afterwards to see where they left their glasses. In accordance with this law, Grebo's soul had noted that there was one extra option for use in a tight corner, in addition to the usual cat assortment of run, fight, crap, or all three together, and that was become human. It tended to wear off after a short time, most of which he spent searching desperately for a pair of pants. There were snores from under the bed. Gradually, to Nanny's relief, they turned into a purr. Then she sat bolt upright. She was some way from the cowshed, but... He's here, she said. End of Side 4 Side 5 Granny breathed out slowly. 
Come and sit where I can see you, that's good manners. And let me tell you right now that I ain't at all afraid of you. The tall, black-robed figure walked across the floor and sat down on a handy barrel, leaning its scythe against the wall. Then it pushed back its hood. Granny folded her arms and stared calmly at the visitor, meeting his gaze, eye to socket. I am impressed. I have faith. Really? In what particular deity? Oh, none of them. Then faith in what? Just faith, you know, in general. Death leaned forward. The candlelight raised new shadows on his skull. Courage is easy by candlelight. Your faith, I suspect, is in the flame. Death grinned. Granny leaned forward and blew out the candle. Then she folded her arms again and stared fiercely ahead of her. After some length of time, a voice said, All right, you've made your point. Granny lit a match. Its flare illuminated the skull opposite, which hadn't moved. Fair enough, she said as she relit the candle. We don't want to be sitting here all night, do we? How many have you come for? One. The cow? Death shook his head. It could be the cow. No, that would be changing history. History is about things changing. No. Granny sat back. Then I challenge you to a game. That's traditional. That's allowed. Death was silent for a moment. This is true. Good. Challenging me by means of a game is allowable. Yes. However, you understand that to win all, you must gamble all. Double or quits, yes, I know. But not chess. Can't abide chess. Or cripple Mr. Onion. I've never been able to understand the rules. Very well. How about one hand of poker? Five cards each, no draws, sudden death, as they say. Death thought about this, too. You know this family? No. Then why? Are we talking or are we playing? Oh, very well. Granny picked up the pack of cards and shuffled it, not looking at her hands, and smiling at death all the time. She dealt five cards each and reached down. A bony hand grasped hers. But first, Mistress Weatherwax, we will exchange cards. He picked up the two piles and transposed them, and then nodded at Granny. Madam? Granny looked at her cards and threw them down. Four queens. Hmm, that is very high. Death looked down at his cards and then up into Granny's steady blue-eyed gaze. Neither moved for some time. Then Death laid the hand on the table. I lose, he said. All I have is four ones. He looked back into Granny's eyes for a moment. There was a blue glow in the depth of his eye sockets. Maybe for the merest fraction of a second, barely noticeable even to the closest observation, one winked off. Granny nodded and extended the hand. She prided herself on the ability to judge people by their gaze and their handshake, which in this case was a rather chilly one. Take the cow, she said. It is a valuable creature. Who knows what the child will become? Death stood up and reached for his scythe. He said... Ow! Ah, yes, I couldn't help noticing, said Granny Weatherwax, as the tension drained out of the atmosphere, that you seemed to be sparing that arm. Oh, you know how it is. Repetitive actions and so on. It could get serious if you left it. How serious? Want me to have a look? Would you mind? It certainly aches on cold nights. Granny stood up and reached out, but her hands went straight through. Look, you're going to have to make yourself a bit more solid if I'm to do anything. Possibly a bottle of sucrose and aqua? Sugar and water? I expect you know that's only for the hard of thinking. Come on, roll up that sleeve. Don't be a big baby. What's the worst I can do to you? Granny's hands touched smooth bone. She'd felt worse. At least these had never had flesh on them. 
She felt, thought, gripped, twisted. There was a click. Ow! Oh. Now try it above the shoulder. Ah,、uh, hmm. Yes, it does seem considerably more free. Yes, indeed, my word, yes. Thank you very much. If it gives you trouble again, you know where I live. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know where everyone lives. Tuesday mornings is a good time. I'm generally in. I shall remember. Thank you. By appointment, in your case. No offence meant. Thank you. Death walked away. A moment later, there was a faint gasp from the cow. That and a slight sagging of the skin were all that apparently marked the transition from living animal to cooling meat. Granny picked up the baby and laid a hand on its forehead. Fever's gone, she said. Mistress Weatherwax said, "Death from the doorway." Yes, sir. I have to know what would have happened if I had not lost. At the cards, you mean? Yes. What would you have done? Granny laid the baby down carefully on the straw and smiled. Well, she said, for a start, I'd have broken your bloody arm. Agnes stayed up late simply because of the novelty. Most people in Lancre, as the saying goes, went to bed with the chickens and got up with the cows.、Uh, that is to say, they went to bed at the same time as the chickens went to bed and got up at the same time as the cows got up. Loosely worded sayings can really cause misunderstandings. But she watched the evening's performance and watched the set being struck afterwards and watched the actors leave or, in the case of the younger chorus members, head off for their lodgings in odd corners of the building. And then there was no one else. Except Walter Plinge and his mother sweeping up, she headed for the staircase. There didn't seem to be a candle anywhere back here, but the few left burning in the auditorium were just enough to give the darkness a few shades. The stairs went up the wall at the rear of the stage, with nothing but a rickety handrail between them and the drop. Besides leading to the attics and the storeroom on the upper floors, there were also one route to the fly loft and the other secret platforms where men in flat hats and grey overalls worked the magic of the theatre. Usually by means of pulleys, there was a figure on one of the gantries over the stage. Agnes saw it only because it moved slightly. It was kneeling down, looking at something in the darkness. She stepped back. The stair creaked. The figure jerked round. A square of yellow light opened in the darkness. Its beam pinning her against the brickwork. "Who's there?" she said, raising a hand to shade her eyes. "Who's that?" said a voice. And then, after a moment, "Oh, it's it's Perdita, isn't it?" The square of light swung towards her as the figure made its way over the stage. Andre, she said, she felt inclined to back away if only the brickwork would let her. And suddenly he was on the stairs, quite an ordinary person, no shadow at all, holding a very large lantern. What are you doing here? said the organist. I was just going to bed. Oh yes, he relaxed a little. Some of you girls have got rooms here. The management thought it was safer than having you going home alone late at night. What are you doing up here? Said Agnes, suddenly aware that there were just the two of them. I was looking at the place where the ghost tried to strangle Mr. Cripps. Said Andre. Why? I wanted to make certain everything was safe. Now, of course. Didn't the stagehands do that? Oh, you know them. I just thought I'd better make certain. Agnes looks down at the lantern. I've never seen one like that before. How did you make it light up so quickly? Uh, it's a dark lantern. There's this flap, you see. He demonstrated, so you can just shut it right down and open it up again. That must be very useful when you're looking for the black notes. Don't be sarcastic. I just don't want there to be any more trouble. You'll find that you start looking around. Good night, Andre. Good night then. She hurried up the rest of the flights and ducked into her bedroom. No one followed her. When she'd calmed down, which took some time, she undressed in the voluminous tent of her red flannel nightdress. And got into bed, resisting any temptation to pull the covers over her head. She stared at the dark ceiling. That's stupid, she thought. Eventually, he was on the stage this morning. No one could move that fast. She never knew whether she actually got some sleep or whether it just happened as she was dozing off. But there was a very faint knock at the door. Perdita. Only one person she knew could exclaim a whisper. Agnes got up and padded over to the door. She opened the door a fraction, just to check. And Christine half fell into the room. What's the matter? I'm frightened. What of? The mirror. 
It's talking to me. Can I sleep in your room? Agnes looked around. It was crowded enough with the two of them standing up in it. The mirror's talking. Yes. Are you sure? Christine dived into Agnes's bed and pulled the covers over. Her. Yes, she said indistinctly. Agnes stood alone in the darkness. People always tended to assume that she could cope, as if capability went with mass, like gravity. And merely saying briskly, "Nonsense, mirrors don't talk," would probably not be any help, especially with one half of the dialogue buried beneath the bedclothes. She felt her way into the next room, stubbing her foot on the bed in the darkness. There must be a candle in here somewhere. She felt for the tiny bedside table, hoping to start the reassuring rattle of a matchbox. A faint glimmer from the midnight city filtered through the window. The mirror seemed to glow. She sat on the bed, which creaked ominously under her. Ah well, one bed was as good as another. She was about to lie back when something in the darkness went, ting. It was a tuning fork, and a voice said, "Christine, please attend." She sat upright, staring at the darkness. And then realization dawned. No men, they'd said. They'd been very strict about that, as if opera was some kind of religion. It was not a problem in Agnes's case, at least in the way they meant. But for someone like Christine, they said love always found a way, and of course, so did a number of associated activities. Oh, good grief! She felt the blush start in darkness. What kind of a reaction was that? Agnes's life unrolled in front of her. It didn't look as though it were going to have many high points, but it did hold years and years of being capable and having a lovely personality. It almost certainly held chocolate rather than sex. And while Agnes was not in a position to make a direct comparison, and regardless of the fact that a bar of chocolate could be made to last all day, it did not seem a very fair exchange. She felt the same feeling she'd felt back home. Sometimes life reaches that desperate point where the wrong thing to do has to be the right thing to do. It doesn't matter what direction you go in. Sometimes you just have to go. She gripped the bedclothes and replayed in her mind the way her friend spoke. You had to have that little gulp, that breathless tinkle in the tone that people got whose minds played with the fairies half the time. She tried it out in her head, and then delivered it to her vocal cords. Yes, who's there? A friend. Agnes pulled the bedclothes up higher. In the middle of the night. Night is nothing to me. I belong to the night, and I can help you. It was a pleasant voice. It seemed to be coming from the mirror. Help me do what? Don't you want to be the best singer in the opera? Oh, Perdita is a lot better than me. There was silence for a moment, and then the voice said, "But while I cannot teach her to look and move like you." I can teach you to sing like her. Agnes stared into the darkness, shock and humiliation rising from her like steam. Tomorrow you will sing the part of Iodine, but I will teach you how to sing it perfectly. Next morning, the witches had the interior of the coach almost to themselves. News like Grebo gets around. But Henry Slug was there, if that was indeed his name, sitting next to a very well-dressed, thin little man. Well, here we are again, then," said Nanny Og. Henry smiled nervously. "That was some good singing last night," Nanny went on. Henry's face set in a good-natured grimace. In his eyes, terror waved a white flag. "I'm afraid Signor Basilica doesn't speak more Porkian, ma'am," said the thin man. But I will translate for you if you like. What? Said Nanny. Then how come? Ow! Sorry. Said Granny Weatherwax. My elbow must have slipped. Nanny Og rubbed her side. I was saying, she said, that he was. Ow! Dear me, I seem to have done it again. Said Granny. This gentleman was telling us that his friend doesn't speak our language, Githa. Hey, but. What? Oh, but、uh, really? No.、Oh. oh, all right," said Nanny. "Oh, yes. Eats our pies, though. When he、uh, ow. Excuse my friend. It's her time of life. She gets confused," said Granny. "We did enjoy his singing. Heard him through the wall. You were very fortunate," said the thin man primly.
Sometimes people have to wait years to hear Signor Basilica. Probably waiting for him to finish his dinner, a voice muttered. In fact, at La Scalda in Genoa last month, his singing made ten thousand people shed tears. Heh, <laughs> I can do that. I don't see there's anything special about that. Granny's eyes hadn't left Henry, Signor Basilica, Slug's face. He had the expression of a man whose profound relief was horribly tempered by a dread that it wouldn't last very long. Signor Basilica's fame has spread far and wide, said the manager primly. Just like Signor Basilica, muttered Nanny. On other people's pies, I expect. Oh yes, too posh for us now, just because he's the only man you could find on an atlas. Ow! Well, well, said Granny, smiling in a way that everyone except Nanny Og would think of as innocent. It's nice and warm in Genoa. I expect a senior basilica really misses his home. And what do you do, young sir? I am his manager and translator. Ah, uh, you have the advantage of me, ma'am. Yes, indeed, Granny nodded. We have some good singers where we come from, too, said Nanny Og, rebelliously. Really? said the manager. And where do you ladies come from? Loncra. The man politely endeavoured to position Loncra on his mental map of great centres of music. Do you have a conservatory there? Yes, indeed, said Nanny Og stoutly. And then, just to make sure, she added, you should see the size of my tomatoes. Granny rolled her eyes. Githa, you haven't got a conservatory. It's just a big window sill. Yes, but it catches the sun nearly all day. Ow! I expect Signor Basilica is going to Ark Moorpork, said Granny. We, said the manager primly, have allowed the Opera House to engage us for the rest of the season. His voice faltered. He looked up at the luggage rack. What's that? Granny glanced up. Oh, that's Grebo, she said. And Mr. Basilica's not to eat him, said Nanny. What is it? He's a cat. It's, it's grinning at me, the manager shifted uneasily, and I can smell something, he said. It's funny, said Nanny, I can't smell a thing. There was a change in the sound of the hooves outside, and the coach lurched as it slowed. Ah, said the manager awkwardly, I, um, I see we're stopping to change horses. It's, uh, a nice day. I think I may just, um, see if there's room on the seats outside. He left when the coach stopped. When it started again a few minutes later, he hadn't come back. Well, well, said Granny as they lurched away again. It seems there's just you and me, Githa, and Signor Basilica, who doesn't speak our language, does he? Mr. Henry Slug. Henry Slug took out a handkerchief and wiped his forehead. Ladies, oh, dear ladies, uh, I, I beg you, for, for, for pity's sake. Have you done anything bad, Mr. Slug? said Nanny. Took advantage of a woman who didn't want to be took advantage of? Stole? apart from lead on roofs and other stuff people wouldn't miss? Done any murders of anyone who didn't deserve it? No. Are you telling the truth, says me? Henry writhed under Granny Weatherwax's stare. Yes. Oh, well, that's all right, then, said Nanny. I understand. I don't have to pay taxes myself, but I know about people not wanting to. Oh, it's not about that, I, I assure you, said Henry. I have people to pay my taxes for me. That's a good trick, said Nanny. Mr Slug's got a different trick, said Granny. I reckon I know the trick. It's like sugar and water. Henry waved his hands uncertainly. It's just that, um, <laughs> if they knew, he began. Everything's better if it comes from a long way away, that's the secret, said Granny. It's, um, <coughs> yes, that's part of it, said Henry. I mean, no one wants to listen to a slug. Where are you from, Henry, said Nanny. Really from, said Granny. I grew up in Rookery Yard in the Shades. They're in Ark Moorpork, said Henry. It was a terrible rough place. There were only three ways out. You could sing your way out or you could fight your way out. Uh, what was the third way, said Nanny. No. Oh. You could go down that little alleyway into Shamlega Street and then cut down into Treacle Mine Road, said Henry, but no one ever amounted to anything who went that way. He sighed. I made a few coppers singing in taverns and such like, he said, but when I tried for anything better they said, What is your name? And I said Henry Slug and they'd laugh. 
I thought of changing my name, but everyone in Ankh-Morpork knew who I was, and no one wanted to listen to anyone called plain Henry Slug. Nanny nodded. It's like with conjurers, she said. They're never called Fred What's the Name. It's always something like the Great Astoundo, fresh from the court of the King of Clutch, and Gladys. And everyone takes notice, said Granny, and are always careful not to ask themselves, if he's come from the King of Clutch, why is he doing card tricks here in Slice, Population 7? The trick is to make sure that everywhere you go you are from somewhere else, said Henry. And then I was famous, but... You'd got stuck as Enrico, said Granny. He nodded. I was only going to do it to make some money. I was going to come back and marry my little Angeline. Who was she, said Granny. Oh, <laughs> a girl I grew up with, said Henry vaguely. Sharing the same gutter in the back streets of Aunt Moorport kind of thing, said Nanny in an understanding voice. Gutter! <laughs> in those days you had to put your name down and wait five years for a gutter! said Henry. We thought people in gutters were knobs. Oh, we shared a drain with two other families and a man who juggled eels, he sighed. But I moved on, and then there was always someone else to go, and they liked me in Brindisi, and... and... He blew his nose on the handkerchief, carefully folded it up, and produced another one from his pocket. I don't mind the pasta and the squid, he said. Well, not much. But you can't get a decent pint for love no money, and they put olive oil on everything, and tomatoes give me the rash, and there isn't what I call a good hard cheese in the whole country. He dabbed at his face with the handkerchief. And people are so kind, he said, I thought I'd get a few beefsteaks when I travelled, but wherever I go they do pasta, especially for me, in tomato sauce. Sometimes they fry it, and what they do to the squid, whoa, he shuddered. Then they all grin and watch me eat it. They think I enjoy it. What I'd give for a plate of nice roast mutton with... with clouty dumplings. Well, why don't you say? said Nanny. He shrugged. Enrico Basilica eats pasta, he said. There's not much I can do about it now. He sat back. You're interested in music, Mrs Ogg? Nanny nodded proudly. I can get a tune out of just about anything if you give me five minutes to study it, she said. And our Jason can play the violin, and our Kev can blow the trombone, and all my kids can sing, and our Sean can fart any melody you care to name. A very talented family indeed, said Enrico. He fumbled in a waistcoat pocket and took out two oblongs of cardboard. So, please, ladies, accept these as a small token of gratitude from someone who eats other people's pies. Our little secret, eh? He winked desperately at Nanny. They're open tickets for the opera. Oh, that's amazing, said Nanny, because we're going to the... Oh! Why, thank you very much, said Granny Weatherwax, taking the tickets. How very gracious of you. We shall be sure to go. And if you'll excuse me, said Enrico, I must catch up on my sleep. Don't worry, I shouldn't think it's had time to get far away, said Nanny. The singer leaned back, pulled the handkerchief over his face, and after a few minutes began to snore the happy snore of someone who had done his duty, and now with any luck wouldn't have to meet these rather disconcerting old women ever again. He's well away, said Nanny after a while. She glanced at the tickets in Granny's hand. You want to visit the opera, she said. Granny stared into space. I said, do you want to visit the opera? Granny looked at the tickets. What I want don't signify, I suspect, she said. Nanny Ogg nodded. Granny Weatherwax was firmly against fiction. Life was hard enough without lies floating around and changing the way people thought. And because the theatre was fiction made flesh, she hated the theatre most of all. But that was it. Hate was exactly the right word. Hate is a force of attraction. Hate is just love with its back turned. She didn't loathe the theatre, because had she done so, she would have avoided it completely. Granny now took every opportunity to visit the travelling theatre that came to Lancre, and sat bolt upright in the front row of every performance, staring fiercely. Even honest Punch and Judy men found her sitting among the children, snapping things like, "'Taint so!' and, "'Is that any way to behave?' As a result, Lancre was becoming known throughout the Stowe Plains as a really tough gig. But what she wanted wasn't important. 
Like it or not, witches are drawn to the edge of things, where two states collide. They feel the pull of doors, circumferences, boundaries, gates, mirrors, masks, and stages. Breakfast was served in the Opera House's refectory at half past nine. Actors were not known for their habit of early rising. Agnes started to fall forward into her eggs and bacon and stopped herself just in time. Good morning! Christine sat down with a tray on which was, Agnes was not surprised to see, a plate holding one stick of celery, one raisin, and about a spoonful of milk. She leaned towards Agnes, and her face very briefly expressed some concern. Are you all right? You look a little peaky. Agnes caught herself in mid-snore. Oh, I'm fine, she said, just a bit tired. Oh, good. This exchange having exhausted her higher mental processes, Christine went back to operating on automatic. Do you like my new dress? she exclaimed. Isn't it fetching? Agnes looked at it. Yes, she said. Very white, very lacy, very figure-hugging. And do you know what? No, what? I already have a secret admirer. Isn't that thrilling? All the great singers have them, you know. A secret admirer? Yes, this dress. It arrived at the stage door just now. Isn't that exciting? Amazing, said Agnes glumly. And it's not as if you've even sung. Er, uh, who's it from? He didn't say, of course. It has to be a secret admirer. He'll probably want to send me flowers and drink champagne out of my shoe. Really? Agnes made a face. Do people do that? It's traditional. Christine, boiling over with cheerfulness, had some to share. You look very tired, she said. Her hand went to her mouth. Oh, we swapped rooms, didn't we? I was so silly. And you know, she added, with that look of half-empty cunning that was the nearest she came to guile, I could have sworn I heard singing in the night. Someone trying scales and things. Agnes had been brought up to tell the truth. She knew she should say, I'm sorry, I appear to have got your life by mistake. There seems to have been a bit of confusion. But, she decided, she'd also been brought up to do what she was told, not to put herself first, to be respectful to her elders, and to use no swear word stronger than poot. She could borrow a more interesting future just for a night or two. She could give it up any time she liked. You know, that's funny, she said, because I'm right next door to you, and I didn't. Oh, well... That's all right, then. Agnes stared at the tiny meal on Christine's tray. Is that all you're having for breakfast? Oh, yes. I could just blow up like a balloon, dear. It's lucky for you. You can eat anything. Don't forget it's practice in half an hour. And she skipped off. She's got a head full of air, Agnes thought. I'm sure she doesn't mean to say anything hurtful. But deep inside her, Perdita X Dream thought... A rude word. Mrs. Plinge took her broom out of the cleaning cupboard and turned. Walter! Her voice echoed around the empty stage. Walter! She tapped the broom handle warily. Walter had a routine. It had taken her years to train him into it. It wasn't like him not to be in the right place at the right time. She shook her head and started work. She could see it would be a mop job later. It would probably be ages before they got rid of the smell of turpentine. Someone came walking across the stage. They were whistling. Mrs. Plinge was shocked. Mr. Pounder! The Opera House's professional rat catcher stopped and lowered his struggling sack. Mr. Pounder wore an old opera hat to show that he was a cut above your normal rodent operative, and its brim was thick with wax and the old candle ends he used to light his way through the dark cellars. He'd worked among the rats so long that there was something rat-like about him now. His face seemed to be merely a rearward extension of his nose. His moustache was bristly, his front teeth were prominent. People found themselves looking for his tail. What's that, Mrs. Plinge? You know you mustn't whistle on stage. That's terrible bad luck. Ah, well, it's cause of good luck, Mrs. Plinge. Oh, yes. If you did know what I'd know, you'd be a happy man, true. Of course, in your case, you'd be a happy woman, on account of you being a woman. Ah, some of the things I've seen, Mrs. Plinge. 
Found gold down there, Mr. Pounder? Mrs. Plinge knelt down carefully to scrape away a spot of paint. Mr. Pounder picked up his sack and continued on his way. Could be gold, Mrs. Plinge. Oh, could very well be gold. It took a moment for Mrs. Plinge to coax her arthritic knees into letting her stand up and shuffle around. Pardon, Mr. Pounder, she said. Somewhere in the distance there was a soft thump as a bundle of sandbags landed gently on the boards. The stage was big and bare and empty, except for a sack which was scuttling determinedly for freedom. Mrs. Plinge looked both ways very carefully. Mr. Pounder, are you there? It suddenly seemed to her that the stage was even bigger and even more distinctly empty than before. Mr. Pounder, cooey! She craned around. Hello, Mr. Pounder! Something floated down from above and landed beside her. It was a grubby black hat with candle ends around the brim. She looked up. Mr. Pounder, she said. Mr. Pounder was used to darkness. It held no fears for him, and he'd always prided himself on his night vision. If there was any light at all, any speck, any glimmer of phosphorescent rot, he could make use of it. His candled hat was as much for show as anything else. His candled hat. He'd thought he'd lost it, but it was strange. Here it was, still on his head. Yes, indeed. He rubbed his throat thoughtfully. There was something important he couldn't quite remember. It was very dark. Squeak! He looked up. Standing in the air at eye level was a robed figure about six inches high. A bony nose with bent grey whiskers protruded from the hood. Tiny skeletal fingers gripped a very small scythe. Mr. Pounder nodded thoughtfully to himself. You didn't rise to membership of the inner circle of the Guild of Rat Catchers without hearing a few whispered rumours. Rats had their own death, they said, as well as their own kings, parliaments, and nations. No human had ever seen it, though. Up until now, he felt honoured. He'd won the golden mallet for most rats caught every year for the past five years, but he respected them as a soldier might respect a cunning and valiant enemy. Um, I'm dead, aren't I? Squeak. Mr. Pounder felt that many eyes were watching him, many small, shining eyes. And what happens now? Squeak. The soul of Mr. Pounder looked at his hands. They seemed to be elongating and getting hairier. He could feel his ears growing at a certain rather embarrassing elongation happening at the base of his spine. He'd spent most of his life in a single-minded activity in dark places, yet even so... But I don't believe in reincarnation, he protested. Squeak! And this, Mr. Pounder understood with absolute rodent clarity, meant reincarnation believes in you. End of side five. Side six. Mr. Bucket went through his mail very carefully and finally breathed out when the pile failed to disgorge another letter with the Opera House crest. He sat back and pulled open his desk drawer for a pen. There was an envelope there. He stared at it, and then slowly picked up his paper knife. Slit a rustle. I will be obliged if Christine sings the role of Iodine in La Triviata tonight. The weather continues fine. I trust you are well. Yours, the Opera Ghost. M Mr. Salzella! Mr. Salzella! Bucket pushed back his chair and hurried to the door, opening it just in time to confront a ballerina who screamed at him. Since his nerves were already strained, he responded by screaming back at her. This seemed to have the effect that usually a wet flannel or a slap was necessary to achieve. She stopped and gave him an affronted look. He's struck again, hasn't he? moaned Bucket. He's here! It's the ghost! said the girl, determined to get the line out even though it was not required. Yes, yes, I think I know, muttered Bucket. I just hope it wasn't anybody expensive. He stopped halfway along the corridor and then spun round. The girl cringed away from his wavering finger. 
At least stand on tiptoe, he shouted. You probably cost me a dollar just running up here. There was a crowd in a huddle on the stage. In the centre was that new girl, the fat one, kneeling down and comforting an old woman. Bucket vaguely recognised the latter. She was one of the staff that had come with the opera house, as much part of the whole thing as the rats or the gargoyles that infested the rooftops. She was holding something in front of her. It just fell out of the flies, she said. His poor hat. Bucket looked up. As his eyes grew accustomed to the darkness, he made out a shape up among the battens, spinning slowly. Oh, dear, he said, and I thought he'd written such a polite letter. Really? Then now read this one, said Salzella, coming up behind him. Must I? It's addressed to you. Bucket unfolded the piece of paper. Aha, ha, 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 ha. Aha, ha, 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 ha. Yours, the opera ghost. P.S. Aha, ha, 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 ha. He gave Salzella an agonized look. Who's the uh, poor fellow up there? Mr. Pounder, the rat catcher. Rope dropped around his neck, other end attached to some sandbags. They went down, he went up. I don't understand. Is, th is this man mad? Salzella put an arm around his shoulders and led him away from the crowd. Well, now, he said, as kindly as he could, a man who wears evening dress all the time, lurks in the shadows and occasionally kills people. Then he sends little notes writing maniacal laughter. Five exclamation marks again, I notice. And we have to ask ourselves, is this the career of a sane man? But, but, but why is he doing it? wailed Bucket. That is only a relevant question if he is sane, said Salzella calmly. He may be doing it because the little yellow pixies tell him to. Sane? How can he be sane? said Bucket. You were right, you know. The atmosphere in this place would drive anyone crazy. I very well may be the only one here with both feet on the ground. He turned. His eyes narrowed when he saw a group of chorus girls whispering nervously. You, girls, don't just stand there. Let's see you jump up and down, he rasped, on one leg. He turned back to Salzella. What was I saying? You were saying, said Salzella, that you have both feet on the ground, unlike the corpse de ballet and the corpse de Monsieur Pounder. I think that comment was in rather poor taste, said Bucket coldly. My view, said the director of music, is that we should shut down, get all the able-bodied men together, issue them with torches, go through this place from top to bottom, flush him out, chase him through the city, catch him and beat him to a pulp, and then throw what's left into the river. It's the only way to be sure. You know we can't afford to shut down, Bucket said. We seem to make thousands a week, but we seem to spend thousands a week too. I'm sure I don't know where it goes. I thought running this place was just a matter of getting bums on seats. But every time I look up, there's a bum spinning gently in the air. Oh, what's he going to do next, I ask myself. They looked at one another, and then, as if pulled by some kind of animal magnetism, their gazes turned and flew out over the auditorium until they found the huge, glittering bulk of the chandelier. Oh, no, moaned Bucket. He wouldn't, would he? That would shut us down. Salzella sighed. Look, it weighs more than a ton, he said. The supporting rope is thicker than your arm. The winch is padlocked when it's not in use. It's safe. They looked at one another. I'll have a man guard it every minute there's a performance, said Salzella. I'll do it personally, if you like. And he wants Christine to sing Iodine tonight. She's got a voice like a whistle. Salzella raised his eyebrows. That, at least, is not a problem, is it? he said. Isn't it? Uh, it's a key role. Salzella put his arm around the owner's shoulders. I think perhaps it is time for you to explore a few more little-known corners of the wonderful world that is opera, he said. The stagecoach rolled to a halt in Sartor Square, Ankh Morpork. The coach agent was waiting impatiently. You're fifteen hours late, Mr. Reaver, he shouted. The coach driver nodded impassively. He laid the reins down, jumped off the box, and inspected the horses. There was a certain woodenness about his movements. 
passengers were grabbing their baggage and hurrying away. Well, said the agent. We had a picnic, said the coach driver. His face was grey. You stopped for a picnic, and a bit of a sing-song, said the driver, pulling the horse's feed bags from under the seat. You are telling me that you stopped the mail coach for a picnic and a sing-song. Oh, and the cat got stuck up a tree. He sucked his hand, and the agent noticed that a handkerchief was tied around it. A hazy look of recollection clouded the driver's eyes. And then there were the stories. He said, "What?" Stories. The little fat one said everyone had to tell a story to help pass the time. Yes. Well, I don't see how that could slow you down. You should have heard her story, the one about the very tall man at the piano. I was so embarrassed I fell off the coach. I wouldn't use words like that even to my own dear grandmother. And of course, said the agent, who prided himself on his ironic approach, the word time table never crossed your mind while all this was going on. The driver turned to look directly at him for the first time. The agent took a step back. He was a man who had hang glided over hell. "You tell 'em," said the driver, and walked away. The agent stared after him, and then walked around to the door. A small man with a hunted look climbed out, dragging a huge fat man behind him, and gabbling urgently in a language the agent didn't understand. And then the agent was left alone with a coach and horses and an expanding circle of hurrying passengers. He opened the door and peered inside. "Good morning, Mister," said Nanny Og. He looked in some puzzlement from her to Granny Weatherwax. "Is everything all right, ladies?" "Very nice journey," said Nanny Og, taking his arm. "We shall definitely patronise you another time." The driver seemed to think there was a problem. Problem," said Granny. "I didn't notice any problems. Did you, Giffer?" "It could have been a bit quicker fetching the ladder," said Nanny, climbing down. "And I'm sure he muttered something under his breath that time we stopped to admire the view. But I'm prepared to be gracious about it." "You stopped to admire the view," said the agent. "When?" "Oh, several times," said Nanny. "No sense in rushing round the whole time, is there? More haste, less speed, etc." Could you point us in the direction of Elm Street? Only we've lodgings at Mrs. Palm's. Our Nev speaks highly of the place. He says no one ever looked for him there. The agent stepped back, as people generally did in the face of Nanny's pump-action chatter. Elm Street, he stuttered. But respectable ladies shouldn't go there. Nanny patted him on the shoulder. That's good, she said. That way we won't run into anyone we know. As Granny walked past the horses, they tried to hide behind the coach. Bucket smiled brightly. There were little beads of sweat around the edges of his face. Ah,、uh, Pajita, he said, "Do、uh, sit down, lass.、Um, are you、uh, enjoying your time with us so far?" "Yes, thank you, Mister Bucket," said Agnes dutifully. Good, good. That's good, isn't it? Isn't that good, Mister Salzilla?、Uh, <laughs> don't you think that's good, Doctor Undershaft? Agnes looked at the three worried faces. We're all very pleased," said Mister Bucket, "and、uh, well, we have an amazing offer for you, which I'm sure will help you to enjoy it even more." Agnes watched the assembled faces. Yes," she said guardedly. "I know you、uh, have only been with us, well, hardly any time, <laughs> but we've decided to."、Um, Bucket swallowed and glanced at the other two for moral support. "Let you sing the part of Iodine in tonight's production of La Triviata." <laughs> "Yes." "Um." It isn't the major role, but of course it does include the famous departure aria. Oh yes,、uh, there is a.、Um, that is a.、Uh, Bucket gave up and looked helplessly at his director of music, Mr. Salzella. Salzella leaned forward. What, in fact, we would like you to do. <laughs> Pedita is sing the role, indeed, but not in fact play the role. Agnes listened while they explained. She'd stand in the chorus just behind Christine. 
Christine would be told to sing very softly. It had been done dozens of times before, Salzella explained. It was done far more often than the audience has ever realised, when singers had a sore throat, or had completely dried, or had turned up so drunk they could barely stand, or in one notorious instance many years previously, had died in the interval and subsequently sung their famous aria by means of a broom handle stuck up their back and their jaw operated with a piece of string. It wasn't immoral. The show had to go on. The ring of desperately grinning faces watched her. I could just walk away, she thought. Walk away from these grinning faces and the mysterious ghost. They couldn't stop me. But there's nowhere to walk to, except back. Yes, er, uh, yes, she said. I'm very, er, uh, but, er, uh, why do it like this? Couldn't I simply take her place and sing the part? The men looked at one another, and then all started talking at once. Yes, but you see, Christine um, has has more um, uh, stage uh, experience. Technical grasp. Stage uh, presence. Uh, apparent uh, lyrical ability uh, fits the costume. Agnes looked down at her big hands. She could feel the blush advancing like a barbarian horde, burning everything as it came. We would like you, as it were, said Bucket, to uh, <laughs> ghost the part. Ghost, said Agnes. It's a stage term, said Salzella. Oh, I see, said Agnes. Yes, well, of course, I shall certainly do my best. Jolly good, said Bucket. We won't forget this. And I'm certain a very suitable part for you will come along very soon. See Dr. Undershaft this afternoon, and he, he will take you through the role. Er, uh, I know it quite well, I think, said Agnes, uncertainly. Really? How? I've been taking lessons. That is good, lass. Hmm, said Mr. Bucket. Shows keenness. Hmm, hmm. We're, we're, we're very impressed. But see Dr. Undershaft in any case. Agnes got up, and still looking down, trooped out. Undershaft sighed and shook his head. Poor child, he said, born too late. Opera used to be just about voices. You know, I remember the days of the great sopranos, Dame Violetta Gigli, Dame Clarissa Extendo. Whatever became of them, I sometimes wonder. Didn't the climate change? said Salzella nastily. There goes a figure that should prompt a revival of the Ring of the Nibelungengang, Undershaft went on. Now that was an opera. Three days of gods shouting at one another and twenty minutes of memorable tunes, said Salzella. No, thank you very much. But can't you hear her singing Hildebrand, leader of the Valkyries? Yes, oh, yes, but unfortunately I can also hear her singing Novo the Dwarf and Eo, chief of the gods. Those were the days, said Undershaft sadly, shaking his head. We had proper opera then. I recall when Dame Veritasi stuffed a musician into his own tuba for yawning. Yes, yes, but this is the century of the fruit bat, said Salzella, standing up. He glanced at the door again and shook his head. Amazing, he said. Do you think she knows how fat she is? The door of Mrs. Palm's discreet establishment opened at Granny's knock. The person on the other side was a young woman, very obviously a young woman. There was no possible way that she could have been mistaken for a young man in any language, especially Braille. Nanny peered around the young lady's powdered shoulder at the red plush and gilt interior beyond, and then up at Granny Weatherwax's impassive face, and then back at the young lady. I'll turn our Neb's hide when I get home, she muttered. Come away, Esme, you don't want to go in there. It'd take too long to explain. Why, Granny Weatherwax, said the girl happily, and who's this? Nanny looked up at Granny, whose expression hadn't changed. Nanny Og. Nanny said eventually. Yes, I'm Nanny Og, Neb's mum, she added darkly. Yes, indeed, yes, on account of me being a... The words, respectable widow woman, tried to range themselves in her vocal cords and shriveled at the sheer enormity of the falsehood, forcing her to settle for mother to him, Nev. Yes, Nev's mum. Hello, Colette, said Granny. What fascinating earrings you are wearing. Is Mrs. Palm at home? 
She's always at home to important visitors," said Colette. "Do come in. Everyone will be so pleased to see you again." There were cries of welcome as Granny stepped into the scarlet gloom. "What? You've been here before?" said Nanny, eyeing the pink flesh and white lace that made up much of the scenery. "Oh yes, Mrs. Palm is an old friend, practically a witch." "You, you do know what kind of place this is, do you, Esme?" said Nanny Og. She felt curiously annoyed. She'd happily give way to Granny's expertise in the worlds of mind and magic, but she felt very strongly that there were some more specialised areas that were definitely Og territory, and Granny Weatherwax had no business even to know what they were. Oh yes," said Granny calmly. Nanny's patience gave out. It's a house of ill repute, is what it is. On the contrary," said Granny. "I believe people speak very highly of it." You knew, and you never told me. Granny raised an ironic eyebrow. The lady who invented the strawberry wobbler. Well, yes, but. We all live life the best way we can, Gither, and there's a lot of people who think witches are bad. Yes, but before you criticise someone, Gither, walk a mile in their shoes," said Granny with a faint smile. "And those shoes she was wearing, I twist me ankle," said Nanny, gritting her teeth. "I'd need a ladder just to get in 'em." It was infuriating the way Granny tricked you into reading her half of the dialogue and opened your mind to yourself in unexpected ways. And it's a welcoming place, and the beds are soft," said Granny. "Warm too, I expect," said Nanny Og, giving in. "And there's always a friendly light in the window." "Dear me, Githa Og, I always thought you were unshockable." "Shockable, no," said Nanny. "Easily surprised, yes." Doctor Undershaft, the chorus master, peered at Agnes over the top of his half-moon spectacles. The um, departure aria, as it is known, he said, is quite a little masterpiece. Not one of the great operatic highlights, but very memorable nevertheless. His eyes misted over. Questa maledetta sings Iodine as she tells Peccadillo how hard it is for her to leave him. Questa maledetta porta si block. Si blocca comunque diavolo lo faccio. He stopped and made great play of cleaning his glasses with his handkerchief. When Jigli sang it, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. He mumbled, "I was there. It was then that I decided that I would." Oh, great days indeed! He put his glasses on and blew his nose. I'll run through it once," he said, "just so that you can understand how it is supposed to go. Very well, Andre." The young man who had been drafted in to play the piano in the rehearsal room nodded and winked surreptitiously at Agnes. She pretended not to have seen him and listened with an expression of acute studiousness as the old man worked his way through the score. "And now," he said, "let us see how you manage." He handed her the score and nodded at the pianist. Agnes sang the aria, or at least a few bars of it. Andre stopped playing and leaned his head against the piano, trying to stifle a laugh. "Hm," <coughs> said Undershaft. "Was I doing something wrong?" "You were singing tenor," said Undershaft, looking sternly at Andre. "She was singing in your voice, sir." "Perhaps you can sing it like、um, Christine would sing it." They started again. Questa maledetta. Undershaft held up both hands. Andre's shoulders were shaking with the effort of not laughing. Yes, yes, accurately observed. I dare say you're right. But could we start again? And、uh, perhaps you could sing it how you think it should be sung. Agnes nodded. They started again, and finished. Undershaft had sat down. Half turned away, he wouldn't look round to face her. Agnes stood watching him uncertainly.、Uh, "Was that all right?" she said. Andre, the pianist, got up slowly and took her hand. "I think we'd better leave him," he said softly, pulling her towards the door. "Was it that bad?" "Not exactly." Undershaft raised his head, but didn't turn it towards her. "More practice on those R's, madam, and strive." For greater security about the stave," he said hoarsely. "Yes, yes, I will. 
Andre led her out into the corridor, shut the door, and then turned to her. That was astounding, he said. Did you ever hear the great Jiggly sing? I don't even know who Jiggly is. What was I singing? You didn't know that either? I don't know what it means, no. Andre looks down at the score in his hand. Well, I'm not much good at the language, but I suppose the opening could be sung something like this. This damn door sticks. This damn door sticks. It sticks no matter what the hell I do. It's marked pull, and indeed I am pulling. Perhaps it should be marked push. Agnes blinked. Well, that's it. Yes, but I thought it was supposed to be very moving and romantic. It is, said Andre. It was. This isn't real life. This is opera. It doesn't matter what the words mean. It's the feeling that matters. Hasn't anyone told? Look. I'm in rehearsals for the rest of the afternoon, but perhaps we could meet tomorrow. Perhaps after breakfast. Oh no, thought Agnes. Here it comes. The blush was moving inexorably upwards. She wondered if one day it might reach her face and carry on going, so that it ended up as a big pink cloud over her head. Er,、uh, yes, she said. Yes, that would be very helpful. Now I've got to go. He gave her a weak little smile and patted her hand. And I'm really sorry it's happening this way, because. That was astounding. He went to walk away and then stopped.、Uh, sorry if I frightened you last night, he said. What? On the stairs? Oh, that! I wasn't frightened. You were.、Uh, didn't mention it to anyone, did you? I'd hate people to think I was worrying over nothing. Hadn't given it another thought to tell you the truth. I know you can't be the ghost if that's what you're worried about, eh? Me? <laughs> the ghost? Ha <laughs> ha! Ha ha! Said Agnes. So.、Uh, See you tomorrow then. Fine. Agnes headed back to her room, deep in thought. Christine was there, looking critically at herself in the mirror. She spun around as Agnes entered. She even moved with exclamation marks. Oh, Perdita! Have you heard? I am to sing the part of Iodine tonight. Isn't that wonderful? She dashed across the room and endeavoured to pick Agnes up and hug her, settling eventually for just hugging her. And I heard they're already letting you in the chorus. Yes, indeed. Isn't that nice? I've been practicing all morning with Mr. Salzella. Casta, maledetta, porker si broker. She twirled happily. Invisible sequins filled the air with their shine. When I'm very famous, she said, you won't regret having a friend in me. I shall do my very best to help you. I'm sure you bring me luck. Yes, indeed, said Agnes hopelessly. Because my dear father told me that one day a dear little pixie would arrive to help me achieve my great ambition, and you know, I think that little pixie is you. Agnes smiled unhappily. After you'd known Christine for any length of time, you found yourself fighting a desire to look into her ear to see if you could spot daylight coming out the other way. Uh, I thought we had swapped rooms. Oh, that," said Christine, smiling. "Wasn't I silly? Anyway, I shall need the big mirror now that I am to be a prima donna. You don't mind, do you? What? No,、oh, no, no, no. Of course not.、Uh, if you're sure. Agnes looked at the mirror and then at the bed and then at Christine. No," she said, shocked at the enormity of the idea that had just presented itself, delivered from the perdita of her soul. I'm sure that will be fine. Doctor Undershaft blew his nose, and tried to tidy himself up. Well, he didn't have to stand for it. Perhaps the child was somewhat on the heavy side, but Jiggly, for example, had once crushed a tenor to death, and no one had thought any worse of her for it. He'd protest to Mister Bucket. Doctor Undershaft was a single-minded man. He believed in voices. It didn't matter what anyone looked like. He never watched opera with his eyes open. It was the music that mattered, not the acting, and certainly not the shape of the singers. What did it matter what shape she was? Dame Tessitura had a beard you could strike a match on, and a nose flattened half across her face. But she was still one of the best basses who ever opened beer bottles with her thumb. Of course, Salzella said that while everyone accepted that large women of fifty could play thin girls of seventeen, people wouldn't accept that a fat girl of seventeen could do it. He said they'd cheerfully swallow a big lie and choke on a little fib. Salzella said that sort of thing. Something was going wrong these days. The whole place seemed sick. If a building could be sick, 
The crowds were still coming, but the money just didn't seem to be there anymore. Everything seemed to be so expensive. And now they were owned by a cheesemonger, for heaven's sake. Some grubby counter-jumper who'd probably want to bring in fancy ideas. What they needed was a businessman. Some clerk who could add up columns of figures properly and not interfere. That was the trouble with all the owners he had experienced. They started off thinking of themselves as businessmen, and then suddenly began to think they could make an artistic contribution. Still, possibly cheesemongers had to add up cheeses. Just so long as this one stayed in his office with the books, and didn't go around acting as though he owned the place just because he happened to own the place. Undershaft blinked. He'd gone the wrong way again. No matter how long you'd been here, this place was a maze. He was behind the stage in the orchestra's room. Instruments and folding chairs had been stacked everywhere. His foot toppled a beer bottle. The twang of a string made him look around. Broken instruments littered the floor. There were half a dozen smashed violins. Several oboes had been broken. The trom had been pulled right out of a trombone. He looked up into someone's face. But why are you... The half-moon spectacles tumbled over and over and smashed on the boards. Then the attacker lowered his mask as smooth and white as the skull of an angel, and stepped forward purposefully. Dr. Undershaft blinked. There was a darkness. A cloaked figure raised its head and looked at him through bony white sockets. Dr. Undershaft's recent memories were a little confused, but one fact stood out. Ah, he said. Got you. You're the ghost. You know, you're rather amusingly wrong. Dr. Undershaft watched another masked figure pick up the body of Dr. Undershaft and drag it into the shadows. Oh, I see. I'm dead. Death nodded. Such would appear to be the case. That was murder. Does anyone know? The murderer. And you, of course. But him. How can... Undershaft began. We must go, said Death. But he just killed me, strangled me with his bare hands. Yes, chalk it up to experience. You mean, I can't do anything about it? Leave it to the living. Generally speaking, they get uneasy when the deceased takes a constructive role in a murder investigation. They tend to lose concentration. You know, you do have a very good bass voice. Thank you. Are there going to be choirs and things? Would you like some? Agnes slipped out through the stage door and into the streets of Arkmorpork. She blinked in the light. The air felt slightly prickly and sharp and too cold. What she was about to do was wrong, very wrong, and all her life she'd done things that were right. Go on, said Perdita. In fact, she probably wouldn't even do it, but there was no harm in just asking where there was a herbal shop. So she asked. And there was no harm in going in, so she went in. And it certainly wasn't against any kind of law to buy the ingredients she bought. After all, she might get a headache later on or be unable to sleep. And it would mean nothing at all to take them back to her room and tuck them under the mattress. That's right, said Perdita. In fact... If you averaged out the moral difficulty of what she was proposing over all the little activities she had to undergo in order to do it, it probably wasn't that bad at all, really. These comforting thoughts were arranging themselves in her mind as she headed back. She turned a corner and nearly walked into Nanny Og and Granny Weatherwax. She flung herself against the wall and stopped breathing. They hadn't seen her, although Nanny's foul cat leered at her over its owner's shoulder. They'd take her back. She just knew they would. The fact that she was a free agent and her own mistress and quite at liberty to go off to Ark Morpork had nothing to do with it. They'd interfere. They always did. She scurried back along the alley and ran as fast as she could to the rear of the opera house. The stage doorkeeper took no notice of her. Granny and Nanny strolled through the city towards the area known as the Isle of Gods. It wasn't exactly Ankh, and it wasn't exactly Morpork, being situated where the river bent so much it almost formed an island. It was where the city kept all those things it occasionally needed, but was uneasy about, like the watch house, the theatres, the prison, and the publishers. 
It was the place for all those things which might go off bang in unexpected ways. Grebo ambled along behind them. The air was full of new smells, and he was looking forward to seeing if any of them belonged to anything he could eat, fight, or ravish. Nanny Og found herself getting increasingly worried. This isn't really us, Esme, she said. Who is it, then? I mean, the book was just a bit of fun. No sense in making ourselves unpopular, is there? Can't have witches being done down, Giffa. I don't feel done down. I felt fine until you told me I was done down, said Nanny, putting her finger on a major sociological point. You've been exploited, said Granny firmly. No, I ain't. Yes, you have. You're a downtrodden mass. No, I ain't. You've been swindled out of your life savings, said Granny. Two dollars? Well, it's all you'd actually saved, said Granny, accurately. Only because I spent everything else, said Nanny. Other people salted away money for their old age, but Nanny preferred to accumulate memories. Well, there you are, then. I was putting that by for some new piping for my still up at Copperhead, said Nanny. You know how that scumble eats away at the metal? Distillation of alcohol was illegal in Lancre. On the other hand, King Verence had long ago given up any idea of stopping a witch doing something she wanted to do, so merely required Nanny Og to keep her still somewhere it wasn't obvious. She thoroughly approved of the prohibition, since this gave her an unchallenged market for her own product, known wherever men fell backwards into a ditch, as suicider. You are putting a little something by for some security and peace of mind in your old age, Granny translated. You don't get peace of mind with my scumble, said Nanny happily. Pieces, yes, but not peace. It's made from the finest apples, you know, she added. Well, mainly apples. End of Side 6《赛德·塞文》Granny stopped outside an ornate doorway and peered at the brass plate affixed thereon. This is the place, she said. They looked at the door. I've never been one for front doors, said Nanny, shifting from one foot to the other. Granny nodded. Witches had a thing about front doors. A brief search located an alleyway which led around the back of the building. Here was a pair of much larger doors, wide open. Several dwarfs were loading bundles of books onto a cart. A rhythmic thumping came from somewhere beyond the doorway. No one took any notice of the witches as they wandered inside. Movable type was known in Ark Morpork, but if wizards heard about it, they moved it where no one could find it. They generally didn't interfere with the running of the city, but when it came to movable type, the pointy foot was put down hard. They had never explained why, and people didn't press the issue, because you didn't press the issue with wizards, not if you liked yourself the shape you were. They simply worked around the problem and engraved everything. This took a long time, and meant that Ankh Morpork was, for example, denied the benefit of newspapers, leaving the population to fool themselves as best they could. A press was thumping gently at one end of the warehouse. Beside it, at long tables, a number of dwarfs and humans were stitching pages together and gluing on the covers. Nanny took a book off a pile. It was The Joy of Snacks. Can I help you, ladies? said a voice. Its tone suggested very clearly that it wasn't anticipating offering any kind of help whatsoever, except out into the street at speed. We've come about this book, said Granny. I'm Mrs. Og, said Nanny Og. The man looked her up and down. Oh, yes. Can you identify yourself? Certainly. I'd know me anywhere. Ha! Huh. Well, I happen to know what Githa Og looks like, madam, and she does not look like you. Nanny Og opened her mouth to reply, and then said in the voice of one who has stepped happily into the road and only now remembers about the onrushing coach, <gasps> Oh! And how do you know what Mrs. Og looks like? said Granny. Oh, is that the time? We'd better be going, said Nanny. Because, as a matter of fact, she sent me a picture, said Goatburger, taking out his wallet. I'm sure we're not at all interested, said Nanny, hurriedly pulling on Granny's arm. 
I'm extremely interested, said Granny. She snatched a folded piece of paper out of Goatburger's hands and peered at it. Ah, yes, that's Giffa Og, all right, she said. Yes, indeed, I remember when that young artist came to Lonkra for the summer. I wore my hair longer in those days, muttered Nanny. Just as well, considering, said Granny. I didn't know you had copies, though. Oh, you know how it is when you're young, said Nanny dreamily. It was doodle, doodle, doodle all summer long. She awoke from her reverie. And I still weigh the same now as I did then, she added. Except that it's shifted, said Granny nastily. She handed the sketch back to Goatburger. That's her, all right, she said. But it's out by about sixty years and several layers of clothing. This is Githerog right here. You're telling me this came up with banana nana soup surprise? Did you try it? said Nanny. Mr. Cropper, the head printer, did, yes. Was he surprised? Not half as surprised as Mrs. Cropper. It can take people like that, said Nanny. I think perhaps I overdo the nutmeg. Goatburger stared at her. Doubt was beginning to assail him. You only had to look at Nanny Og grinning back at you to believe she could write something like The Joy of Snacks. Did you really write this? he said. From memory, said Nanny proudly. And now she'd like some money, said Granny. Mr. Goatburger's face twisted up as though he'd just eaten a lemon and washed it down with vinegar. But we gave her the money back, he said. See, said Nanny, her face falling, I told you, Esme. She wants some more, said Granny. No, I don't. No, she doesn't, Goatburger agreed. She does, said Granny. She wants a little bit of money for every book you've sold. I don't expect to be treated like royalty, said Nanny. Strictly speaking, this means being chased by photographers anxious to get a picture of you with your vest off. You shut up, said Granny. I know what you want. We want some money, Mr. Goatburger. And what if I won't give it to you? Granny glared at him. Then we shall go away and think about what to do next, she said. That's no idle threat, said Nanny. There's a lot of people have regretted Esme thinking about what to do next. Come back when you've thought, then, snapped Goatburger. He stormed off. Oh, I don't know. Authors wanting to be paid. Good grief. He disappeared among the stacks of books. Er, uh, do you think that could have gone better? said Nanny. Granny glanced at the table beside them. It was stacked with long sheets of paper. She nudged a dwarf, who had been watching the argument with some amusement. What are these? she said. They're proofs for the almanac. He saw her blank expression. They're sort of a trial run for the book, so as we can check that all the spelling mistakes have been left in. Granny picked it up. Come, Githa, she said. I don't want trouble, Lesby, said Nanny Og as she hurried after her. It's only money. It ain't money any more, said Granny. It's a way of keeping score. Mr. Bucket picked up a violin. It was in two pieces, held together by the strings. One of them broke. Who do something like this? He said. Honestly, Salzella, what is the difference between opera and madness? Is this a trick question? No. Then I'd say, better scenery. Ah, I thought so. Salzella rooted among the destruction and stood up with a letter in his hand. Would you like me to open it? He said. It's addressed to you. Bucket shut his eyes. Go on, he said. Don't bother about the details. Just tell me how many exclamation marks. Five. Oh. Salzella passed the paper over. Bucket read. Dear Bucket. Whoops. Ha 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 ha. Yours, the Opera Ghost. What can we do, he said. One moment he writes polite little notes. The next he goes mad on paper. Herr Trubelmarker has got everyone out hunting for new instruments, said Salzella. Are violins more expensive than ballet shoes? There are few things in the world more expensive than ballet shoes. Violins happen to be among them, said Salzella. <gasps> oh, further expense? It seems so, yes. But I thought the ghost liked music. Herr Trubelmarker tells me the organ is, is, is beyond repair. He stopped. He was aware that he had exclaimed a little less rationally than a sane man should. 
Oh, well, Bucket continued wearily. The show must go on, I suppose. Yes, indeed, said Salzella. Bucket shook his head. How's it all going for tonight? I think it will work, if that's what you mean. Perdita seems to have a very good grasp of the part. And Christine? She has an astonishingly good grasp of wearing a dress. Between them, they make one prima donna. The proud owner of the opera house got slowly to his feet. It all seemed so simple, he moaned. I thought, opera, how hard can it be? Songs, pretty girls dancing, nice scenery, lots of people handing over cash. Got to be better than the cutthroat world of yoghurt, I thought. <laughs> now, everywhere I go, there's... Something crunched under his shoe. He picked up the remains of a pair of half-moon spectacles. These are, um, Dr. Undershafts, aren't they? He said. What are they doing here? His eyes met Salzella's steady gaze. Oh, no, he groaned. Salzella turned slightly and stared hard at a big double base case leaning against the wall. He raised his eyebrows. Oh, no, said Bucket again. Go on, open it. My hands have gone all sweaty. Salzella padded across to the case and grasped the lid. Ready? Bucket nodded wearily. The case was flung open. Oh, no. Salzella craned round to see. Ah, yes, he said. A broken neck, and the body has been kicked in considerably. That'll cost a dollar or two to repair, and no mistake. All the strings are busted. Are double bases more expensive to rebuild than violins? I am afraid that all musical instruments are incredibly expensive to repair, with the possible exception of the triangle, said Salzella. However, could have been worse, hmm? What? Well, it could have been Dr. Undershaft in there, yes? Bucket gaped at him, and then shut his mouth. Oh, uh, yes, yes, of course, oh, yes, that would have been worse. Yes, bit of luck there, I suppose, yes, hmm? So that's an opera house, is it? said Granny. Looks like someone built a great big box and glued the architecture on afterwards. She coughed and appeared to be waiting for something. Can we have a look around? said Nanny, dutifully, aware that Granny's curiosity was equalled only by her desire not to show it. It can't do any harm, I suppose, said Granny, as if granting a big favour. Seeing as we've nothing else to do right this minute. The Opera House was indeed that most efficiently multifunctional of building designs. It was a cube. But as Granny had pointed out, the architect had suddenly realised late in the day that there ought to be some sort of decoration, and had shoved it on hurriedly in a riot of friezes, pillars, corribants and curly bits. Gargoyles had colonised the higher reaches. The effect, seen from the front, was of a huge wall of tortured stone. Round the back, of course, there was the usual drab mess of windows, pipes, and damp stone walls. One of the rules of a certain type of public architecture is that it only happens at the front. Granny paused under a window. Someone's singing, she said. Listen. La 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 la, trilled someone. Do re mi fa sol la ti do. That's opera right enough, said Granny. Sounds foreign to me. Nanny had an unexpected gift for languages. She could be comprehensibly incompetent in a new one within an hour or two. What she spoke was one step away from gibberish, but it was authentically foreign gibberish. And she knew that Granny Weatherwax, whatever her other qualities, had an even bigger tin ear for languages than she did for music. Uh, could be, she said. There's always a lot going on, I know that. Our Nev said they sometimes do different operations every night. How did he find that out? said Granny. Well, there was a lot of lead. That takes some shifting. He said he liked the noisy ones. He could hum along, and also no one heard the hammering. The witches strolled onwards. Did you notice young Agnes nearly bump into us back there? said Granny. Yes, it was all I could do not to turn around, said Nanny. She wasn't very pleased to see us, was she? I practically heard her gasp. That's very suspicious, if you ask me said Nanny. I mean, she sees two friendly faces from back home. You'd expect her to come running up. We're old friends, after all. Old friends of a grandma and a mum, anyway. And that's practically the same. Remember those eyes in the teacup, said Nanny. She could be under the gaze of some strange occult force. We got to be careful. 
People can be very tricky when they're in the grip of a strange occult force. Remember Mr. Scruple over in Slice? That wasn't a strange occult force. That was at his stomach. Well, it certainly seemed strangely occult for a while, especially if the windows were shut. The perambulation had taken them to the Opera House's stage door. Granny looked up at the line of posters. La Triviata, she read aloud. The Ring of the Nibelungengang. Well, basically, there are two sorts of opera, said Nanny, who also had the true witch's ability to be confidently expert on the basis of no experience whatsoever. There's your heavy opera, where basically people sing foreign and it goes like, Oh, oh I am dying, oh, I'm dying, oh, that's what I'm doing. And there's your light opera, where they sing in foreign and it basically goes, Beer, 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 I like to drink lots of beer. Although sometimes they drink champagne instead. That's basically all of opera, really. What? Either dying or drinking beer? Basically, yes, said Nanny, contriving to suggest that this was the whole gamut of human experience. And that's opera? Well, there might be some other stuff, but mostly it's stout or stabbing. Granny was aware of a presence. She turned. A figure had emerged from the stage door, carrying a poster, a bucket of glue and a brush. It was a strange figure, a sort of neat scarecrow, in clothes slightly too small for it. Although, to be truthful, there were probably no clothes that would have fit that body. The ankles and wrists seemed infinitely extensible and independently guided. It encountered the two witches standing at the poster board and stopped politely. They could see the sentence marshalling itself behind the unfocused eyes. Excuse me, ladies, the show must go on. The words were all there and they made sense, but each sentence was fired out into the world as a unit. Granny pulled Nanny to one side. Thank you. They watched in silence as the man, with great and meticulous care, applied paste to a neat rectangle and then affixed the poster, smoothing every crease methodically. What's your name, young man? said Granny. Walter. That's a nice beret you have there. My mum bought it for me. Walter chased the last air bubble to the edge of the paper and stood back. Then, completely ignoring the witches in his preoccupation with his task, he picked up the paste pot and went back inside. The witches stared at the new poster in silence. You know, I wouldn't mind seeing an operation, said Nanny after a while. Signor Basilica did give us the tickets. Oh, you know me, said Granny. Can't be having with that sort of thing at all. Nanny looked sideways at her and grinned to herself. This was a familiar weatherwax opening line. It meant, of course I want to, but you've got to persuade me. You're right, of course, she said. It's for them folks in all their fine carriages. It's not for the likes of us. Granny looked hesitant for a moment. I expect it's having ideas above our station, Nanny went on. I expect if we went in they'd say, be off, you nasty old crones. Oh, they would, would they? I don't expect they want common folk like what we are coming in with all those smart, knobby people, said Nanny. Is that a fact? Is that a fact, madam? You just come with me. Granny stalked round to the front of the building, where people were already alighting from coaches. She pushed her way up the steps and shouldered through the crowd to the ticket office. She leaned forward. The man behind the grill leaned back. Nasty old crones, eh? She snapped. I beg your pardon? Not before time. See here? We've got tickets for, uh... She looked down at the pieces of cardboard and pulled Nanny Og over. It says here stalls. The cheek of it. Stalls? Us? She turned back to the ticket man. See here? Stalls aren't good enough. We want seats in... She looked up at the board by the ticket window. The gods. Yes. That sounds about right. I'm sorry? You've got tickets for stall seats and you want to exchange them for seats in the gods? Yes, and don't you go expecting us to pay any more money. I, I wasn't going to ask you for... Just as well, said Granny, smiling triumphantly. She looked approvingly at the new tickets. Come, Githa. Uh, excuse me, said the man as Nanny Og turned away. 
But what is that on your shoulders? It's a fur collar, said Nanny. Excuse me, but I just saw it flick its tail. Yes, I happen to believe in beauty without cruelty. Agnes was aware of something happening backstage. Little groups of men were forming and then breaking up as various individuals hurried away about their mysterious tasks. Out in front, the orchestra was already tuning up. The chorus was filing on to be a busy marketplace in which various jugglers, gypsies, sword swallowers, and gaily dressed yokels would be entirely unsurprised at an apparently drunken baritone strolling on to sing an enormous amount of plot at a passing tenor. She saw Mr. Bucket and Mr. Salzella deep in argument with the stage manager. How can we search the entire building? This place is a maze. He, he might have just uh, uh, wandered off somewhere. He's as blind as a bat without those glasses. But we can't be certain something's happened to him. Oh, yes. You didn't say that when we opened the double base case. You were certain he was going to be inside. Admit it. I, 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 I wasn't expecting just to find a smashed double base, yes. But I, I was feeling a bit mithered at that point. A sword swallower nudged Agnes. What? Curtain up in one minute, dear, he said, smearing mustard on his sword. Has something happened to Dr. Rundershaft? Couldn't say, dear. You wouldn't have any salt, would you? Excuse me. Excuse me. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Oh, oh, was that your foot? Oh, excuse me. Leaving a trail of annoyed and pained patrons in their wake, the witches trod their way to their seats. Granny elbowed herself comfortable and then, having in some matters the boredom threshold of a four-year-old, said, What's happening now? Nanny's skimpy knowledge of opera didn't come to her aid, so she turned to the lady beside her. Excuse me, uh, could I borrow your programme? Thank you. Excuse me, could I borrow your spectacles? So kind. She spent a few moments in careful study. Hmm, this is the overture, she said. It's kind of a free sample of what's going to happen. It's got a summary of the story, too. La Triviata. Her lips moved as she read. Occasionally, her brow wrinkled. Well, it's quite simple, really, she said at last. A lot of people are in love with one another. There's considerable dressing up as other people and general confusion. There's a cheeky servant, no one really knows who anyone is, a couple of old dukes go mad, chorus of gypsies, etc. Your basic opera. Someone's probably going to turn out to be someone else's long-lost son or daughter or wife or something. Shh, said a voice behind them. Wish we'd brought something to eat, muttered Granny. I think I've got some peppermints in my knicker leg. Shh. I would like my spectacles back, please. Here you are, Mum. They're not very good, are they? Someone tapped Nanny Og on the shoulder. Madam, your first stole is eating my chocolates. And someone tapped Granny Weatherwax on her shoulder. Madam, kindly remove your hat. Nanny Og choked on her peppermint. Granny Weatherwax turned to the red-faced gentleman behind her. You do know what a woman in a pointy hat is, don't you? She said. Yes, madam. A woman in a pointy hat is sitting in front of me. Granny gave him a stare. And then, to Nanny's surprise, she removed her hat. I do beg your pardon, she said. I can see I was inadvertently bad-mannered. Pray excuse me. She turned back to the stage. Nanny Og started breathing again. You feeling all right, Esme? Never better. Granny Weatherwax surveyed the auditorium, oblivious to the sounds around her. I assure you, madam, your fur is eating my chocolates. It started on the second layer. Oh, dear. Uh, show him the little map inside the lid, will you? He's only after the truffles, and you can soon rub the dribble off the others. Do you mind being quiet? I don't mind. It's this man and his chocolates that's making the noise. A big room, Granny thought. A great big room without windows. There was a tingling in her thumbs. She looked at the chandelier. The rope disappeared into an alcove in the ceiling. Her gaze passed along the rows of boxes. They were all quite crowded. On one, though, the curtains were almost closed, as if someone inside wanted to see out without being seen. Then Granny looked among the stalls. The audience was mainly human. Here and there was the hulking shape of a troll, although the troll equivalent of operas usually went on for a couple of years. A few dwarf helmets gleamed, although dwarfs normally weren't interested in anything without dwarfs in. 
There seemed to be a lot of feathers down there, and here and there the glint of jewellery. Shoulders were being worn bare this season. A lot of attention had been paid to appearances. The people were here to look, not to see. She closed her eyes. This was when you started being a witch. It wasn't when you did headology on daft old men, or mixed up medicines, or stuck up for yourself, or knew one herb from another. It was when you opened your mind to the world and carefully examined everything it picked up. She ignored her ears until the sounds of the audience became just a distant buzz. Or at least a distant buzz broken by the voice of Nanny Og. Says here that Dame Tim Panny, who sings the part of Quizella, is a diver, said Nanny. So I reckon this is like a part-time job then. Probably quite a good idea on account of you have to be able to hold your breath. Good training for the singing. Granny nodded without opening her eyes. She kept them closed as the opera started. Nanny, who knew when to leave her friends to her own devices, tried to keep quiet but felt impelled to give out a running commentary. Then she said, Ah, oh, there's Agnes! Hey, hey, that's Agnes! Stop waving and sit down, murmured Granny, trying to hold on to her waking dream. Nanny leaned over the balcony. She's dressed up as a gypsy, she said, and now there's a girl coming forward to sing. She peered at the stolen programme. The famous... Departure aria, it says here. Now that's what I call a good voice. That's Agnes singing, said Granny. No, it's this girl, Christine. Shut your eyes, you daft old woman, and tell me if that isn't Agnes singing, said Granny. Nanny Og obediently shut her eyes for a moment and then opened them again. <gasps> it's Agnes singing! Yes, but there's that girl with a big smile right out there in front, moving her lips and everything. Yes. Nanny scratched her head. Something a bit wrong here, Esme. Can't have people stealing out Agnes's voice. Granny's eyes were still shut. Tell me if the curtains on that box down there on the right have moved, she said. I just saw them twitch, Esme. Ah. Granny let herself relax again. She sank into the seat as the aria washed over her and opened her mind once more. Edges, walls, doors. Once the space was enclosed, it became a universe of its own. Some things remained trapped in it. The music passed through one side of her head and out the other, but with it came other things, strands of things, echoes of old screams. She drifted down further, down below the conscious, into the darkness beyond the circle of firelight. There was fear here. It stalked the place like a great dark animal. It lurked in every corner. It was in the stones. Old terror crouched in the shadows. It was one of the most ancient terrors, the one that meant that no sooner had mankind learned to walk on two legs than it dropped to its knees. It was the terror of impermanence, the knowledge that all this would pass away, that a beautiful voice or a wonderful figure was something whose arrival you couldn't control and whose departure you couldn't delay. It wasn't what she'd been looking for, but it was perhaps the sea in which it swam. She went deeper. And there it was, roaring through the nighttime of the soul of the place like a deep, cold current. As she drew closer, she saw that it was not one thing, but two, twisted around one another. She reached out. Trickery, lies, deceit, murder. No! She blinked. Everyone had turned to look at her. Nanny tugged at her dress. Sit down, Esme! Granny stared. The chandelier hung peacefully over the crowded seats. They beat him to death. What's that, Esme? And they throw him into the river. Esme, shh. Madam, will you sit down at once? And now it's started on the Nougat Whirls. Granny snatched at her hat and did a crabwise run along the row, crushing some of the finest footwear in Ankh Morpork under her thick lancre soles. Nanny hung back reluctantly. She'd quite enjoyed the song and she wanted to applaud, but her pair of hands wasn't necessary. The audience had exploded as soon as the last note had died away. Nanny Og looked at the stage and took note of something and smiled. Like that, eh? Get that! She sighed. Coming, Esme. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, sorry. Uh, excuse me. Granny Weatherwax was out in the red plush corridor, leaning with her forehead against the wall. This is a bad one, Githa, she muttered. It's all twisted up. I ain't at all sure I can make it happen right. The poor soul... She straightened up. Look at me, Githa, will you? Githa obediently opened her eyes wide. She winced a little as a fragment of Granny Weatherwax's consciousness crept behind her eyes. 
Granny put her hat on, tucking in the occasional errant wisp of grey hair, and then taking one by one the eight hat pins and ramming them home with the same frowning deliberation with which a mercenary might check his weapons. All right, she said at last. Nanny Og relaxed. It's not that I mind, Esme, she said, but I wish you'd use a mirror. Waste of money, said Granny. Now fully armoured, she strode off along the corridor. Glad to see you didn't lose your temper with the man who went on about your hat, said Nanny, running along behind. No point. He's going to be dead tomorrow. Oh dear, what of? Run over by a cart, I think. Why didn't you tell him? I could be wrong. Granny reached the stairs and thundered down them. Where are we going? I want to see who's behind those curtains. The applause, distant but still thunderous, filled the stairwell. They certainly like Agnes's voice, said Nanny. Yes, I hope we're in time. Oh, bugger. What? I left Grebo up there. Merely likes meeting new people. Good grief, this place is a maze. Granny stepped out into a curved corridor, rather plusher than the one they had left. There was a series of doors along it. Ah, now then. She walked along the row, counting, and then tried a handle. Can I help you, ladies? They turned. A little old woman had come up softly behind them, carrying a tray of drinks. Granny smiled at her. Nanny Og smiled at the tray. We were just wondering, said Granny, which person in these boxes likes to sit with the curtains nearly shut. The tray began to shake. Here, shall I hold that for you? said Nanny. You'll spill something if you're not careful. What do you know about box eight? said the old lady. Ah, oh, box eight, said Granny. That'd be the one, yes. That's this one over here, isn't it? No, please. Granny strode forward and grasped the handle. The door was locked. The tray was thrust into Nanny's welcoming hands. Well, thank you. I don't mind if I do, she said. The woman pulled at Granny's arm. Don't! It'll bring terrible bad luck. Granny thrust out her hand. The king, madam. Behind her, Nanny inspected a glass of champagne. Don't make him angry. It's bad enough as it is. The woman was clearly terrified. Iron, said Granny, rattling the handle. Can't magic iron. Here, said Nanny, stepping forward a little unsteadily. Give me one of your hat pins. Our nebs taught me all kinds of tricks. Granny's hand rose to her hat, and then she looked at Mrs. Plinge's lined face. She lowered her hand. No, she said. No, I reckon we'll leave it for now. I don't know what's happening, sobbed Mrs. Plinge. It never used to be like this. Have a good blow, said Nanny, handing her a grubby handkerchief and patting her kindly on the back. There was none of this killing people. He just wanted somewhere to watch the opera. It made him feel better. Who's this we're talking about? said Granny. Nanny Og gave her a warning look over the top of the old woman's head. There were some things best left to Nanny. He'd unlock it for an hour every Friday for me to tidy up, and there was always his little note saying thank you or apologising for the chocolates down the seat. <laughs> and where was the harm in it? That's what I'd like to know. Have another good blow, said Nanny. And now there's people dropping like flies out of the flies. They say it's him, but I know he never meant any harm. Course not, said Nanny soothingly. Many's the time I've seen them look up at the box. They always felt the better for it if they saw him. And then poor Mr. Pounder was strangulated. I looked around and there was his hat, just like that. It's terrible when that happens, said Nanny Og. What's your name, dear? <laughs> Mrs. Plinge. Sniffed Mrs. Plinge. It came right down in front of me. I'd have recognised it anywhere. I think it would be a good idea if we took you home, Mrs. Plinge, said Granny. Oh dear, I've got all these ladies and gentlemen to see to. And anyway, it's dangerous going home this time of night. Walter walks me home, but he's got to stay late tonight. Oh dear. Have another good blow, said Nanny. Find a bit that isn't too soggy. There was a series of sharp pops. Granny Weatherwax had interlocked her fingers and extended her hands at arm's length so that her knuckles cracked. Dangerous, eh? She said. Well, we can't see you all upset like this. I'll walk you home, and Mrs. Og will see to things here. Only I've got to attend to the boxes. I've got all these drinks to serve. Could have sworn I had them a moment ago. 
Mrs. Og knows all about drinks, said Granny, glaring at her friend. There's nothing I don't know about drinks, agreed Nanny, shamelessly emptying the last glass, especially these. End of Side 7 Side 8 and, and what about our Walter? He'll worry himself silly. Walter's your son, said Granny. Where's a beret? The old woman nodded. Only I always comes back for him if he's working late, she began. You come back for him, but he sees you home, said Granny. It's... Well, uh, he's... he's... Mrs. Plinge rallied. He's a good boy, she said defiantly. I'm sure he is, Mrs. Plinge, said Granny. She carefully lifted the little white bonnet off Mrs. Plinge's head and handed it to Nanny, who put it on and also took the little white apron. That was the good thing about black. You could be nearly anything wearing black, Mother Superior or Madam. It was really just a matter of the style. It just depended on the details. There was a click. Box 8 had bolted itself. And then there was the very faint scrape of a chair being wedged under the door handle. Granny smiled and took Mrs. Plinge's arm. I'll be back as soon as I can, she said. Nanny nodded and watched them go. There was a little cupboard at the end of the corridor. It contained a stool, Mrs. Plinge's knitting, and a small but very well-stocked bar. There were also, on a polished mahogany plank, a number of bells on big coiled springs. Several of them were bouncing up and down angrily. Nanny poured herself a gin, and gin with a dash of gin, and inspected the rows of bottles with considerable interest. Another bell started to ring. There was a huge jar of stuffed olives. Nanny helped herself to a handful and blew the dust off a bottle of port. A bell fell off its spring. Somewhere out in the corridor, a door opened and a young man's voice bellowed, Where are those drinks, woman? Nanny tried the port. Nanny Og was used to the idea of domestic service. As a girl, she'd been a maid at Lancre Castle, where the king was inclined to press his intentions and anything else he could get hold of. Young Giffa Og had already lost her innocence, without regret, since she hadn't found any use for it, but she had some clear ideas about unwelcome intentions, and when he jumped out at her in the scullery, she had technically committed treason with a large leg of lamb swung in both hands. That had ended her life below stairs and put a lengthy crimp in the king's activities above them. The brief experience had given her certain views, which weren't anything so definite as political, but were firmly oggish. And Mrs. Plinge had looked as if she didn't get very much to eat, and not a lot of time to sleep either. Her hands had been thin and red. Nanny had a lot of time for the Plinges of the world. Did port go with sherry? Ah, uh, well, no harm in trying. All the bells were ringing now. It must be coming up to the interval. She methodically unscrewed the top off a jar of cocktail onions and thoughtfully crunched a couple. Then, as other people started to poke their heads around the doors and make angry demands, she went to the champagne shelf and took down a couple of magnums. She gave them a damn good shake, tucked one under each arm with a thumb on the corks, and stepped out into the corridor. Nanny's philosophy of life was to do what seemed like a good idea at the time, and do it as hard as possible. It had never let her down. The curtains closed. The audience was still on its feet, applauding. What happens now? whispered Agnes to the next gypsy. He pulled off his bandana. Well, dear, we generally nip out to... Oh, no, they're going for a curtain call. The curtains opened again. The light caught Christine, who curtsied and waved and sparkled. Her fellow gypsy nudged Agnes. Look at Dame Timpani, he said. There's a nose in a sling if ever I saw one. Agnes stared at the prima donna. She's smiling, she said. So does a tiger, dear. The curtains shut once more, with a finality that said the stage manager was going to strike the set and would scream at someone if they dared to touch those ropes again. Agnes ran off with the others. There wasn't too much to do in the next act. She'd tried to memorise the plot earlier, although other members of the chorus had done their best to dissuade her, on the basis that you could either sing them or understand them, but not both. Nevertheless, Agnes was conscientious. So Peccadillo, tenor, the son of Duke Tagliatella, bass, 
has secretly disguised himself as a swineherd to woo Quizella, not knowing that Dr. Bufola, baritone, has sold the elixir to Ludi, the servant, without realising he is really the maid Iodine, soprano, dressed up as a boy because Count Arto, baritone, claims that a deputy stage manager pulled her out of the way and waved at someone in the wings. Lose the countryside, Ron. There was a series of whistles from off stage, answered by another from above. The back cloth rose. From the gloom above, the sandbag counterweights began to descend. Then Arto reveals uh, that Zebeline must marry Fideli, I mean Fiabi, not knowing uh, that the family fortunes, the sandbags came down, on one side of the stage at least. On the other side, Agnes was interrupted in her impossible task by the screaming, and looked around into the upside-down and not at all well features of the late Dr. Undershaft. Nanny skipped through a handy door, shut it behind her and leaned on it. After a few moments the sound of running feet clattered past. Well, that had been fun. She removed the lace bonnet and apron, and because there was a basic honesty in Nanny, she tucked them in a pocket to give back to Mrs. Plinge later. Then she pulled out a flat, round, black shape and banged it against her arm. The point shot out. After a few adjustments, her official hat was almost as good as new. She looked around. A certain absence of light and carpeting, together with a very presence of dust, suggested that this was part of the place the public weren't supposed to see. Oh, damn. She supposed she had better find another door. Of course, that had mean she'd have to leave Grebo, wherever he was, but he'd turn up. He always did when he wanted feeding. There was a flight of steps leading down. She followed them to a corridor which was slightly better lit and ambled along it for quite a way, and then all she had to do was follow the screams. She emerged among the flats and jumbled props backstage. No one bothered about her. The appearance of a small, amiable old lady was not about to cause comment at this point. People were running backwards and forwards, shouting. More impressionable people were just standing in one place and screaming. A large lady was sprawled over two chairs having hysterics, while some distracted stagehands tried to fan her with a script. Nanny Og was not certain whether something important had happened, or whether this was just a continuation of opera by other means. I should loosen her corsets if I was you, she said as she ambled past. Good heavens, madam, there's enough panic in here as it is. Nanny moved on to an interesting crowd of gypsies, noblemen and stagehands. Which is a curious by definition and inquisitive by nature. She moved in. Let me through, I'm a nosy person, she said, employing both elbows. It worked, as this sort of approach generally does. There was a dead person lying on the floor. Nanny had seen death in a wide variety of guises, and certainly knew strangulation when it presented itself. It wasn't the nicest end, although it could be quite colourful. Oh dear, she said, poor man. What happened to him? Mr. Bucket says he must have got caught up in the... Someone began. He didn't get caught in anything. This is the ghost's work, said someone else. He could still be up there. All eyes turned upwards. Mr. Salzella sent some stagehands to flush him out. Have they got flaming torches? said Nanny. Several of them looked at her as if wondering for the first time who she was. What? Got to have flaming torches when you're tracking down evil monsters, said Nanny. Well known fact. There was a moment while this sunk in, and then... That's true. She's right, you know. Well known fact, dear. Did they have flaming torches? Don't think so, just ordinary lanterns. Oh, they're no good, said Nanny. That's for smugglers' lanterns. For evil monsters you need flaming tor... Excuse me, boys and girls. The stage manager had stood on the box. Now he said, a little pale around the face. I know you're all familiar with the phrase, the show must go on. There was a chorus of groans from the chorus. It's very hard to sing a jolly song about eating hedgehogs when you're waiting for an accident to happen to you, shouted a gypsy king. Funny thing, if we're talking about songs about hedgehogs, I myself, Nanny began, but no one was paying her any attention. Now, we don't actually know what happened. Really? Shall we guess? said a gypsy. But we have men up in the fly loft now. Oh, in case of more accidents. And Mr. Bucket has authorised me to say that there will be an additional two dollars bonus tonight in recognition of your bravely agreeing to continue with the show. 
Money! After a shock like this, money! He thinks he can offer us a couple of dollars and will agree to stay on this cursed stage. Shame. Heartless. Unthinkable. Should be at least four. Right, right. For shame, my friends, to talk about a few dollars when there is a dead man lying there. Have you no respect for his memory? Exactly. A few dollars is disrespectful. Five dollars are nothing. Nanny Og nodded to herself and wandered off and found a sufficiently big piece of cloth to cover the late Dr. Undershaft. Nanny rather liked the theatrical world. It was its own kind of magic. That was why Esme disliked it, she reckoned. It was the magic of illusions and misdirection and foolery. And that was fine by Nanny Og, because you couldn't be married three times without a little fooling. But it was just close enough to Granny's own kind of magic to make Granny uneasy, which meant she couldn't leave it alone. It was like scratching an itch. People didn't take any notice of little old ladies who looked as though they fitted in, and Nanny Og could fit in faster than a dead chicken in a maggot factory. Besides, Nanny had one additional little talent, which was a mind like a buzzsaw behind a face like an elderly apple. Someone was crying. A strange figure was kneeling beside the late chorus master. It looked like a puppet with the strings cut. "'Can you give me a hand with this sheet, mister?' said Nanny quietly. The face looked up. Two watery eyes running with tears blinked at Nanny. "'He won't wake up!' Nanny mentally changed gear. "'That's right, love,' she said. "'You're Walter, ain't you?' "'He was always very good to me and our mum. "'He never gave me a kick.' It was obvious to Nanny that there was no help here. She knelt down and began to do her best with the departed. Miss, they say it were the ghost, miss. It weren't the ghost, miss. He'd never do a thing like that. He was always good to me and our mum. Nanny changed gear again. You had to slow down a bit for Walter Plinge. My mum'd know what to do. Yes, well, she's gone home early, Walter. Walter's waxy face started to contort into an expression of terminal horror. She mustn't walk home without Walter to look after her, he shouted. I bet she always says that, said Nanny. I bet she always makes sure her Walter's with her when she goes home. But I expect that right now she'd want her Walter to just get on with things so she can be proud of him. Show's not half over yet. It's dangerous for our mum. Nanny patted his hand and absent-mindedly wiped her own hand on her dress. That's a good boy, she said. Now, I've got to go off. The ghost wouldn't harm no one. Yes, Walter, only I've got to go, but I'll find someone to help you, and you must put poor Dr. Undershaft somewhere safe until after the show, understand? And I'm Mrs. Ogg. Walter gawked at her and then nodded sharply. Good boy. Nanny left him still looking at the body and headed further backstage. A young man hurrying past found that he'd suddenly acquired an og. "'Excuse me, young man,' said Nanny, still holding his arm. "'But do you know anyone round here called Agnes? Agnes Knit?' "'Can't say I do, ma'am. What does she do?' He made to hurry on as politely as possible, but Nanny's grip was steel. "'She sings a bit. Big girl. Voice with double joints in it. Wears black. "'Oh, you don't mean Perdita?' "'Perdita? Oh, yes, that'd be her, all right. "'I think she's singing to Christine. They're in Mr. Salzella's office.' Would Christine be the thin girl in white? Yes, ma'am. And I expect you're going to show me where this Mr. Salzella's office is. Am I? Uh, yeah, yes. It's just along the stage there, first door on the right. What a good boy to help an old lady, said Nanny. Her grip increased to a few ounces short of cutting off circulation. And wouldn't it be a good idea if you helped young Walter back there do something respectful for the poor dead man? Back where? Nanny turned around. The late Dr. Undershaft had gone nowhere, but Walter had vanished. Poor chap was a bit upset, I shouldn't wonder, said Nanny. Only to be expected, so how about if you got another strapping young lad to help you out instead? Um, uh, yes. What a good boy, Nanny repeated. It was mid-evening. Granny and Mrs. Plinge pushed their way through the crowds towards the shades, a part of the city that was as thronged as a rookery, fragrant as a cesspit, and vice versa. So, said Granny, as they entered the network of fetid alleys, your boy Walter usually sees you home, does he? He's a good boy, Mistress Weatherwax, said Mrs. Plinge defensively. 
I'm sure you're grateful for a strong lad to lean on, said Granny. Mrs. Plinge looked up. Looking into Granny's eyes was like looking into a mirror. What you saw looking back at you was yourself, and there was no hiding place. They torment him so, she mumbled. They poke at him and hide his broom. They're not bad boys round here, but they will torment him. He brings his broom home, does he? He looks after his things, said Mrs. Plinge. I've always brought him up to look after his things and not be a trouble, but they will poke the poor soul and call him such names. The alleyway opened into a yard like a well between the high buildings. Washing lines crisscrossed the rectangle of moonlit sky. I'm just in here, said Mrs. Plinge. Much obliged to you. How does Walter get home without you? said Granny. Oh, well, there's plenty of places to sleep in the opera house. He knows that if I don't come for him, he's to stop there for the night. He does what he's told, Mistress Weatherwax. He's never any trouble. I never said he was. Mrs. Plinge fumbled in her purse, as much to escape Granny's stare as to look for the key. I expect your Walter sees most of what goes on in the opera house, said Granny, taking one of Mrs. Plinge's wrists in her hand. I wonder what your Walter saw. The pulse jumped at the same time as the thieves did. Shadows unfolded themselves. There was the scrape of metal. A low voice said, There's two of you ladies and the six of us. There's no use in screaming. Oh, dearie, dearie me, said Granny. Mrs. Plinge dropped to her knees. Oh, please don't hurt us, kind sirs. We are harmless old ladies. Haven't you got mothers? Granny rolled her eyes. Damn, damn and blast. She was a good witch. That was her role in life. That was the burden she had to bear. Good and evil were quite superfluous when you'd grown up with a highly developed sense of right and wrong. She hoped, oh, she hoped, that young though these were, they were dyed in the wool criminals. I had a mother once, said the nearest thief. Only I think I must have et her. Ah, top marks. Granny raised both her hands to her hat to draw out two long hatpins. A tile slid off the roof and splashed into a puddle. They looked up. A caped figure was visible for a moment against the moonlight. It thrust out a sword at arm's length. Then it dropped, landing lightly in front of one astonished man. The sword whirled. The first thief spun and thrust at the shadowy shape in front of him, which turned out to be another thief, whose arm jerked up and dragged its own knife along the ribcage of the thief beside him. The masked figure danced among the gang, his sword almost leaving trails in the air. It occurred to Granny later that it never actually made contact, but then it never needed to. When six are against one in a melee in the shadows, and especially if those six aren't used to a target that is harder to hit than a wasp, and even more so if they got all their ideas of knife fighting from other amateurs, then there's six chances in seven that they'll stab a crony, and about one chance in twelve that they'll nick their own earlobe. The two that remained uninjured after ten seconds looked at one another, turned and ran. And then it was over. The surviving vertical figure bowed low in front of Granny Weatherwax. Ah, Bella Donna! There was a swirl of black cloak and red silk, and it too was gone. For a moment soft footsteps could be heard skimming over the cobbles. Granny's hand was still halfway to her hat. Well, I never, she said. She looked down. Various bodies were groaning or making soft bubbling noises. Deary, deary me, she said. Then she pulled herself together. I reckon we're going to need some nice hot water and some bits of bandage and a good sharp needle for the stitching, Mrs. Plinge, she said. We can't let these poor men bleed to death now, can we? Even if they do try to rob old ladies. Mrs. Plinge looked horrified. We've got to be charitable, Mrs. Plinge, Granny insisted. I'll pump the fire up and tear up a sheet, said Mrs. Plinge. Don't know if I can find a needle. Oh, I expect I've got a needle, said Granny, extracting one from the brim of her hat. She knelt down by a fallen thief. It's rather rusty and blunt, she added, but we shall have to do the best we can. The needle gleamed in the moonlight. His round, frightened eyes focused on it, and then on Granny's face. He whimpered. His shoulder blades tried to dig him into the cobbles. It was perhaps as well that no one else could see Granny's face in the shadows. Let's do some good, she said. Salzella threw his hands in the air. Supposing he'd come down in the middle of the act, he said. All right, all right, 
said Bucket, who was sitting behind his desk as a man might hide behind a bunker. I agree. After the show, we call in the watch. No two ways about it. We shall just have to ask them to be discreet. Discreet? Have you ever met a watchman? said Salzella. Not that they'll find anything. He'll have been over the rooftops and away. You may depend upon it, whoever he is. Poor Dr. Undershaft. He was always so highly strong. Never more so than tonight, said Salzella. That was tasteless. Salzella leaned over the desk. Tasteless or not, the company are theatre people. Superstitious. One little thing like someone being murdered on stage and they go all to pieces. He wasn't murdered on stage. He was murdered off stage. And we can't be sure it was murder. He'd been very depressed lately. Agnes had been shocked. But it hadn't been shock at Dr. Undershaft's death. She'd been astonished at her own reaction. It had been startling and unpleasant to see the man, but even worse to see herself actually being interested in what was happening, in the way people reacted, in the way they moved, in the things they said. It had been as if she'd stood outside herself watching the whole thing. Christine, on the other hand, had just folded up. So had Dame Timpani. Far more people had fussed over Christine than around the prima donna, despite the fact that Dame Timpani had come around and fainted again quite pointedly several times and had eventually been forced to go for hysterics. No one had assumed for a minute that Agnes couldn't cope. Christine had been carried into Salzella's backstage office and put on a couch. Agnes had fetched a bowl of water and a cloth and was wiping her forehead, for there are some people who are destined to be carried to comfortable couches and some people whose only fate is fetching a bowl of cold water. Curtain goes up again in two minutes, said Salzella. I'd better go and round up the orchestra. They'll be in the stab in the back over the road. The swine can get through half a pint before the applause has died away. Are they capable of playing? They never have been, so I don't see why they should start now said Salzella. They are musicians, Bucket. The only way a dead body would upset them is if it fell in their beer, and even then they'd play if you offered them dead body money. Bucket walked over to the recumbent Christine. How is she? She keeps mumbling a bit, Agnes began. Cup of tea? Tea? Cup of tea, anyone? Nothing nicer than a cup of tea. Well, I tell a lie, but I see the couch is occupied. <laughs> Just my little joke. No offence, meant. Anyone for a nice cup of tea? Agnes looked around in horror. Well, I could certainly do with one, said Bucket, with false joviality. How about you, miss? Nanny winked at Agnes. Er, uh, no, thank you. Do you work here? said Agnes. I'm just helping out for Mrs. Plinge, who has been taken poorly, said Nanny, giving her another wink. I'm Mrs. Og. Don't mind me. This seemed to satisfy Bucket, if only because random tea distributors represented the most minor of threats at this point. It's more like the Grand Guignol than opera out there tonight, said Nanny. She nudged Bucket. It's foreign, for blood all over the stage, she said helpfully. Uh, really? Yep, it means... Big Gignol. Music started in the distance. That's the overture to Act Two, said Bucket. Well, if Christine is still unwell, then... He looked desperately at Agnes. Well, at a time like this, people would understand. Agnes's chest swelled further with pride. Yes, Mr. Bucket? Perhaps we could find you a, a white... Uh... Christine, her eyes still shut, raised her wrist to her forehead and groaned. Oh, dear! What happened? Bucket knelt down instantly. Are you all right? You had a nasty shock. Do you think you could go on for the sake of your art and people not asking for their money back? She gave him a brave smile. Unnecessarily brave, it seemed to Agnes. I can't disappoint the dear public, she said. Jolly good, said Bucket. I should hurry on out there, then. Perdita will help you, won't you, Perdita? Yes, of course. And you'll be in the chorus for the duet, said Bucket. Nearby, in the chorus. Agnes sighed. Yes, I know. Come on, Christine. Dear Perdita, said Christine. <laughs> Nanny watched them go. Then she said, I'll have that cup if you're finished with it. Oh, uh, y uh, yes, yes, it, it, it was very nice, said Bucket. Uh, I had a bit of an accident up at the boxes, said Nanny. Bucket clutched at his chest. How many died? Oh, no one died. No one died, 
They got a bit damp because I spilled some champagne. Bucket sagged with relief. Oh, I uh, wouldn't worry about that, he said. When I say spilled, I mean it went on happening. He waved her away. It cleans up well off the carpet, he said. Does it stain ceilings, Mrs. Ogg? Please just go away. Nanny nodded, gathered up the teacups and wandered out of the office. If no one questioned an old lady with a tea tray, they certainly weren't bothered about one behind a pile of washing up. Washing up is a badge of membership anywhere. As far as Nanny Ogg was concerned, washing up was also something that happened to other people, but she felt that it might be a good idea to stay in character. She found an alcove with a pump and a sink in it, rolled up her sleeves and set to work. Someone tapped her on the shoulder. You shouldn't do that, you know, said a voice. That's very unlucky. She glanced around at a stagehand. What? Washing up causes seven years bad luck, she said. You were whistling. Well, I always whistle when I'm thinking. You shouldn't whistle on stage, I meant. It's unlucky. I suppose you could say that. We use whistle codes when we're shifting the scenery. Having a sack of sandbags land on you could be unlucky, I suppose. Nanny glanced up. His gaze followed hers. Just here, the ceiling was about two feet away. It's just safest not to whistle, the boy mumbled. I'll remember that, said Nanny. No whistling. Interesting. We do live and learn, don't we? The curtain went up on Act Two. Nanny watched from the wings. The interesting thing was the way in which people contrived to keep one hand higher than their necks in case of accidents. They seemed to be far more salutes and waves and dramatic gestures than were strictly called for in the opera. She watched the duet between Iodine and Buffola, possibly the first in the history of the opera, where both singers kept their eyes turned resolutely upwards. Nanny enjoyed music as well. If music were the food of love, she was game for a sonata and chips at any time. But it was clear that the sparkle had gone out of things tonight. She shook her head. A figure moved through the shadows behind her and reached out. She turned and looked at a fearsome face. Oh, hello, Esme. How did you get in? You've still got the tickets, so I had to talk to the man on the door. But he'll be right as rain in a minute or two. What's been happening? Well, the Duke's sung a long song to say that he must be going, and the Count has sung a song saying how nice it is in the springtime, and a dead body's fallen out of the ceiling. That goes on a lot in opera, does he? Shouldn't think so. Ah, in the theatre I've noticed if you watch dead bodies long enough you can see them move. Doubt if this one'll move. Strangled. Someone's murdering opera people. I've been chatting to the ballet girls. Indeed. It's this ghost they're all talking about. Hmm. Where's one of those black opera suits and a white mask? How did you know that? Granny looked smug. I mean, I can't imagine who'd want to murder opera people. Nanny thought of the expression on Dame Timpani's face. Except perhaps other opera people, and perhaps the musicians, and some of the audience, perhaps. I don't believe in ghosts," said Granny firmly. "Oh, it's me. You know, I've got a dozen of 'em in me house." Oh, I believe in ghosts," said Granny. "Sad things hanging around, going woogie woogie woogie, but I don't believe they kill people or use swords." She walked away a little. "There's too many ghosts here already." Nanny kept quiet. It was best to do so when Granny was listening without using her ears. "Githa," yes, says me. "What does Bella Donna mean?" "It's the knobby name for deadly nightshade," says me. "I thought so." <laughs> The cheek of it! Only in opera it means beautiful woman. Really? Oh! Granny's hand reached up and patted the iron-hard bun of her hair. Oh, foolishness! He'd moved like music, like someone dancing to a rhythm inside his head, and his face, for a moment in the moonlight, was the skull of an angel. The duet got another standing ovation. Agnes faded gently back into the chorus. She had to do little else during the remainder of the act except dance, or at least move as rhythmically as she could, with the rest of the chorus during the Gypsy Fair, and listen to the Duke singing a song about how lovely the countryside was in summer, with an arm extended dramatically above his head. She kept peering into the wings. If Nanny Ogg was here, then the other one would be around somewhere. She wished she'd never written those wretched letters home. Well, they wouldn't drag her back, no matter what they tried.
The remainder of the opera passed without anyone dying, except where the score required them to do so at some length. There was a minor upset when a member of the chorus was almost brained by a sandbag dislodged from a gantry by the stagehands stationed there to prevent accidents. There was more applause at the end. Christine got most of it, and then the curtains closed, and opened and closed a few times as Christine took her bows. Agnes felt perhaps she took one more bow than the applause really justified. Perdita, looking out through her eyes, said, Of course she did. And then they closed the curtains for the last time. The audience went home. From the wings and up in the flies, the stagehands whistled their commands. Parts of the world vanished into the aerial darkness. Someone went around and put out most of the lights. Rising like a birthday cake, the chandelier was winched into its loft so that the candles could be snuffed. Then there were the footsteps of the men leaving the loft. Within twenty minutes of the last hand clap of applause, the auditorium was empty and dark, except for just a few lights. There was the clank of a bucket. Walter Plinge walked onto the stage, if such a word could be employed for his mode of progress. He moved like a puppet on elastic strings, so that it seemed only coincidentally that his feet touched the ground. Very slowly and very conscientiously he began to mop the stage. After a few minutes a shadow detached itself from the curtains and walked over to him. Walter looked down. Hello, Mr. Pussycat, he said. Grebo rubbed against his legs. Cats have an instinct for anyone daft enough to give them food, and Walter certainly was well qualified. I shall go and find you some milk, shall I, Mr. Cat? Grebo purred like a thunderstorm. Walking his strange walk, advancing only by averages, Walter disappeared into the wings. There were two dark figures sitting in the balcony. Sad, said Nanny. He's got a good job in the warm and his mother keeps an eye on him, said Granny. A lot of people fare worse. Not a big future for him, though, said Nanny. Not when you think about it. There was a couple of cold potatoes and half a herring for their supper, said Granny. Hardly a stick of furniture, too. Shame. Mind you, she's a little bit richer now, Granny conceded. Especially if she sells all those knives and boots, she added to herself. It's a cruel world for old ladies, said Nanny. Matriarch of a vast extended tribe and undisputed tyrant of half the Ramtops. Especially one as terrified as Mrs. Plinge, said Granny. Well, I'd be frightened too, if I was old and had Walter to think about. I ain't talking about that gither. I know about fear. That's true, said Nanny. Most of the people you meet are full of fear. Mrs. Plinge is living in fear, said Granny, appearing not to hear this. Her mind is flat with it. She can't hardly think for the terror. I could feel it coming off her like mist. Why? Because of the ghost? I don't know yet. Not all of it anyway, but I will find out. Nanny fished in the recesses of her clothing. Fancy a drink, she said. There was a muffled clink from somewhere in her petticoats. I got champagne, brandy and port. Also some nibbles and biscuits. Githa Og, I believe you are a thief, said Granny. I ain't, said Nanny, and added, with that grasp of advanced morality that comes naturally to a witch, just because I occasionally technically steal something, that doesn't make me a thief. I don't think thief. Let's get back to Mrs. Palms. All right, said Nanny, but can we get something to eat first? I don't mind the cooking, but the grub there is a bit of an all-day breakfast, if you know what I mean. End of Side 8、Side、nine. There was a sound from the stage as they stood up. Walter had returned, followed by a slightly fatter Grebo. Oblivious to the watchers, he continued to mop the stage. First thing tomorrow, said Granny, we'll go and see Mr. Goatburger, the almanac man, again. I've had time to think about what to do next. And then, we're going to sort this out. She glared at the innocent figure washing the stage and said under her breath, What is it you know, Walter Plinge? What is it you've seen? Wasn't it amazing? Said Christine, sitting up in bed. Her nightdress, Agnes had noted, was white and extremely lacy. Yes, indeed, said Agnes. Fa! 
five curtain calls. Mr. Bucket says that's more than anyone's had since Dame Jiggly. I'm sure I won't be able to sleep for the excitement. So you just drink up that lovely hot milk drink I've done for us, said Agnes. It took me ages to carry the saucepan up those stairs. And the flowers, said Christine, ignoring the mug Agnes had placed beside her. They started arriving right after the performance. Mr. Bucket said, he said. There was a soft knock at the door. Christine adjusted her dress. Come. The door opened, and Walter Plinge shuffled in, hidden under the bouquets of flowers. After a few steps, he stumbled on his own feet, plunged forwards, and dropped them. Then he stared at the two girls in mute embarrassment, turned suddenly, and walked into the door. Christine giggled. "Sorry, ma'am,、uh, miss," said Walter. "Thank you, Walter," said Agnes. The door closed. "Isn't he strange? Have you seen the way he stares at me? Do you think you could find some water for these perdita?" "Certainly, Christine. It's only seven flights of stairs, and as a reward, I shall drink this lovely drink you have made for me. Has it got spices in it?" Oh yes, spices," said Agnes. "It's not like one of those potions your witches cook up, is it?" "Er,、uh, no," said Agnes. After all, everyone in Lancre used fresh herbs. "Er,、uh, there's not going to be anything like enough vases for them all, even if I use the gazanda." "The what?" "The you know it goes under the bed gazanda." "Oh, you're so funny." There won't be anyway," said Agnes, blushing hotly. Behind her eyes, Perdita committed murder. Then put in all the ones from the earls and knights, and I shall see to the others tomorrow," said Christine, picking up the drink. Agnes picked up the kettle and started towards the door. "Perdita, dear," said Christine, the mug halfway to her lips. Agnes turned. It did seem to me you were singing the teetiest bit loud, dear. I'm sure it must have been a little difficult for everyone to hear me. Sorry, Christine," said Agnes. She walked down in the darkness. Tonight there was a candle burning in a niche on every second landing. Without them, the stairs would have been merely dark. With them, shadows crept and leapt at every corner. She reached the pump in the little alcove by the stage manager's office and filled the kettle. Out on the stage, someone began to sing. It was Peccadillo's part of a duet of three hours earlier, but sung without music. And in a tenor voice of such tone and purity that the kettle dropped out of Agnes's hand and spilled cold water over her feet. She listened for a while and then realised that she was singing the soprano part under her breath. The song came to an end. She could hear far off the hollow sound of footsteps retreating in the distance. She ran to the door to the stage, paused a moment, and then opened it and went forward and out onto the huge dim emptiness. The candles left burning were as much illumination as stars on a clear night. There was no one there. She walked into the centre of the stage and stopped, and caught her breath at the shock. She could feel the auditorium in front of her, the huge, empty space, making the sound that velvet would make if it could snore. It wasn't silence. The stage is never silent. It was the noise produced by a million other sounds that have never quite died away: the thunder of applause, the overtures, the arias. They poured down fragments of tunes. Lost chords, snatches of song. She stepped back, and trod on someone's foot. Agnes spun around. Andre, there's no. Someone crouched back. Sorry, miss. Agnes breathed out. Walter. Sorry, miss. It's all right. You just startled me. Didn't see you, miss. Walter was holding something. To Agnes's amazement, the darker shape in the darkness was a cat. Flopped over Walter's arms like an old rug and purring happily, it was like seeing someone poking their arm into a mincing machine to see what was jamming it. That's Grebo, isn't it? He's a happy cat. He's full of milk. Walter, why are you in the middle of the stage in the dark when everyone's gone home? What were you doing, Miss? It was the first time she'd heard Walter ask a question. And he's sort of a janitor, after all. She told herself he can go anywhere. I, I got lost. She said, ashamed at the lie. I, I'll be going up to my room now.、Uh, did you hear someone singing? All the time, Miss. I meant just now. Just now, I'm talking to you, Miss. Oh. Good night, Miss. 
She walked through the soft, warm gloom to the backstage door, resisting at every step the urge to look around. She collected the kettle and hurried up the stairs. Behind her on the stage, Walter carefully lowered Grebo to the floor, took off his beret, and removed something white and papery from inside it. What shall we listen to, Mr. Cat? I know we shall listen to the Overture to D. Fledderleaf by J.Q. Bubbler, Cond Votua Doinov. Grebo gave him the fat-cheeked look of a cat prepared to put up with practically anything for food, and Walter sat down beside him and listened to the music coming out of the walls. When Agnes got back to the room, Christine was already fast asleep, snoring the snore of those in herbal heaven. The mug lay by the bed. It wasn't a bad thing to do, Agnes reassured herself. Christine probably needed a good night's sleep. It was practically a kindly act. She turned her attention to the flowers. There were quite a lot of roses and orchids. Most of them had cards attached. Many aristocratic men apparently appreciated good singing, or at least good singing that appeared to come from a face like Christine's. Agnes arranged the flowers, lancre fashion, which was to hold the pot with one hand and the bouquet in the other and forcibly bring the two into conjunction. The last bunch was the smallest and wrapped in red paper. There was no card. In fact, there were no flowers. Someone had merely wrapped up half a dozen blackened and spindly rose stems and then, for some reason, sprayed them with scent. It was musky and rather pleasant, but a bad joke all the same. She threw them in the bin with the rubbish, blew out the candle and sat down to wait. She wasn't certain for whom, or what. After a minute or two, she was aware that there was a glow coming from the waste bin. It was the barest fluorescence, like a sick glowworm, but it was there. She crawled across the floor and peered in. There were rosebuds on the dead sticks, transparent as glass, visible only by the glimmer on the edge of each petal. They flickered like marsh lights. Agnes lifted them out carefully and fumbled in the darkness for the empty mug. It wasn't the best of vases, but it would have to do. Then she sat and watched the ghostly flowers until... someone coughed. She jerked her head up, aware that she'd fallen asleep. Madam? Sir? The voice was melodious. It suggested that at any minute it might break into song. Attend. Tomorrow you must sing the part of Laura in Il Truccatore. We have much to do. One night is barely enough. The aria in Act One will occupy much of our time. There was a brief passage of violin music. Your performance tonight was good. But there are areas that we must build upon. Attend. Did you send the roses? You like the roses? They bloom only in darkness. Who are you? Was it you I heard singing just now? There was a silence for a moment. Yes. Then, let us examine the role of Laura in Il Truccatore, the master of disguise, also sometimes vulgarly known as the man with a thousand faces. When the witches arrived at Goatburger's offices next morning, they found a very large troll sitting on the stairs. It had a club across its knees and held up a shovel-sized hand to prevent them going any further. No one's allowed in, it said. Mr. Goatburger is in a meeting. How long is this meeting going to be? said Granny. Mr. Goatburger is a very elongated meter. Granny gave the troll an appraising stare. You been in publishing long, she said. Since this morning, said the troll proudly. Mr. Goatburger gave you the job? Yep. Come up Quarry Lane and pick me special for... The troll's brow creased as it tried to remember the unfamiliar words. The fast track in a fast moving world of publishing. And what exactly is your job? Head hitter. Excuse me, said Nanny, pushing forward. I'd know that stratum anywhere. You're from Copperhead in Lanka, ain't you? So what? We're from Lanka too. Yeah? This is Granny Weatherwax, you know. The troll gave her a disbelieving grin, and then its brow corrugated again, and then it looked at Granny. She nodded. The one you boys call Auger Hoa. You know, said Nanny, she who must be avoided. The troll looked at its club, as if seriously considering the possibility of beating itself to death. Granny patted it on the lichen-encrusted shoulder. What's your name, lad? 
Carborundum, miss, it mumbled. One of its legs began to tremble. Well, I'm sure you're going to make a good life for yourself here in the big city, said Granny. Yes. Why don't you go and start now, said Nanny. The troll gave her a grateful look and fled without even bothering to open the door. Do they really call me that, said Granny. Uh, yes, said Nanny, kicking herself. It's a mark of respect, of course. Oh, uh, I've always done my best to get along with trolls, you know that. Oh, yes. How about the dwarfs, said Granny, as someone might who had found a hitherto unsuspected boil and couldn't resist poking it. Have they got a name for me too? Let's go and see Mr. Goatburger, shall we, said Nanny brightly. Githa? Uh, well, I, I think it's, um, Kesrek de Budduz, said Nanny. What does that mean? Uh, go around the other side of the mountain, said Nanny. Oh. Granny was uncharacteristically silent as they made their way up the stairs. Nanny didn't bother to knock. She opened the door and said, coo Mr. Gortberger, it's us again, just like you said. Oh, I shouldn't try and get out of the window like that. You're three flights up and that bag of money is a bit dangerous if you're climbing around. The man edged around the room so that his desk was between him and the witches. Wasn't there a troll downstairs, he said. It's decided to break out of publishing, said Nanny. She sat down and gave him a big smile. I expect you've got some money for us. Mr. Goatburger realised that he was trapped. His face contorted into a series of twisted expressions as he experimented with some replies. Then he smiled as widely as Nanny and sat down opposite her. Of course, things are very difficult at the moment, he said. In fact, I can't recall a worse time, he added with considerable honesty. He looked at Granny's face. His grin stayed where it was, but the rest of his face began to edge away. People just don't seem to be buying books, he said, and the cost of the etchings, well, it's wicked. Everyone I know buys the almanac, said Granny. I reckon everyone in Lankra buys your almanac. Everyone in the whole Ramtops buys the almanac, even the dwarfs. That's a lot of half dollars, and Githa's book seems to be doing very well. Well, of course, I'm glad it's so popular, but what with distribution, paying the peddlers, the wear and tear on the... Your almanac will last a household all winter, with care, said Granny, providing no one's ill and the paper's nice and thin. My son Jason buys two copies, said Nanny. Of course, he's got a big family. The privy door never stops swinging. Yes, but you see, the point is, I don't actually have to pay you anything, said Mr Goatburger, trying to ignore this. His smile had the face all to itself now. You paid me to print it, and I gave you your money back. In fact, I think our accounts department made a slight error in your favour, but I won't go in. His voice trailed away. Granny Weatherwax was unfolding a sheet of paper. These predictions for next year, she said. Where'd you get that? I borrowed it. You can have it back if you like. Well, what about them? They're wrong. What do you mean, they're wrong? They're predictions. I don't see there being a rain of curry and clatch next May. You don't get curry that early. You know about the predictions business, said Goatburger. You? I've been printing predictions for years. I don't do clever stuff for years ahead like you do, Granny admitted, but I'm pretty accurate if you want a thirty-second one. Indeed? What's going to happen in thirty seconds? Granny told him. Goatburger roared with laughter. Oh, yes, that's a good one. You should be writing them for us he said. Oh, my word, nothing like being ambitious, eh? That's better than the spontaneous combustion of the Bishop of Quirm. And that didn't even happen. <laughs> In thirty seconds, eh? No. No? Twenty-one seconds now, said Granny. Mr. Bucket had arrived at the Opera House early to see if anyone had died so far today. He made it as far as his office without a single body dropping out of the shadows. He really hadn't expected it to be like this. He'd liked opera. It had all seemed so artistic. He'd watched hundreds of operas and practically no one had died, except once during the ballet scene in La Triviata, when a ballerina had rather over-enthusiastically been flung into the lap of an elderly gentleman in the front row of the stalls. She hadn't been hurt, but the old man had died in one incredibly happy instant. Someone knocked at the door. Mr. Bucket opened it about a quarter of an inch. Who's dead? he said. No one, Mr. Bucket. I've got your letters. 
Oh, oh, it's you, Walter. Thank you. He took the bundle and shut the door. There were bills. There were always bills. The opera house practically runs itself, they'd told him. Well, yes, but it practically ran on money. He rummaged through the letters. There was an envelope with the opera house crest on it. He looked at it like a man looks at a very fierce dog on a very thin leash. It did nothing except lie there and look as gummed as an envelope can be. Finally, he disemboweled it with the paper knife and then flung it down on the desk again as if it would bite. When it did not do so, he reached out hesitantly and withdrew the folded letter. It read as follows. My dear Bucket, I would be most grateful if Christine sings the role of Laura tonight. I assure you she is more than capable. The second violinist is a little slow, I feel, and the second act last night was frankly extremely wooden. This really is not good enough. May I extend my own welcome to Signor Basilica. I congratulate you on his arrival, wishing you the very best. The Opera Ghost. M Mr. Salzella! Salzella was eventually located. He read the note. You do not intend to accede to this, he said. She does sing superbly, Salzella. You mean the knit girl? Well, well, yes, 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 you know what I mean. But this is nothing less than blackmail. Is it? He's not actually threatening anything. You let her, I mean, I mean them, of, of, of course. You let them sing last night and much good it did poor Dr. Undershaft. What do you advise then? There was another series of disjointed knocks on the door. Come in, Walter, said Bucket and Salzella together. Walter jerked in, holding the coal scuttle. I've been to see Commander Vimes of the City Watch, said Salzella. He said he'll have some of his best men here tonight. Undercover. I thought you said they were all incompetent. Salzella shrugged. We've got to do this properly. Did you know Dr. Undershaft was strangled before he was hung? Hanged, said Bucket, without thinking. Men are hanged. It's dead meat that's hung. Indeed, said Salzella, I appreciate the information. Well, poor old Undershaft was strangled, apparently, and then he was hung. Really, Salzella, you do have a misplaced sense. I've finished now, Mr. Bucket. Yes. Thank you, Walter. You may go. Yes, Mr. Bucket. Walter closed the door behind him very conscientiously. I'm afraid it's working here, said Salzella. If you don't find some way of dealing with... Are you all right, Mr. Bucket? What? Bucket, who'd been staring at the closed door, shook his head. Oh, uh, yes, uh, Walter. What about him? He's, um, he's, uh, <laughs> all right, is he? Oh, he's got his funny little ways. He's harmless enough, if that's what you mean. Some of the stagehands and musicians are a bit cruel to him, you know, sending him out for a tin of invisible paint or a bag of nail holes and so on. He believes what he's told. Why? Oh, I, I, I just, uh, just wondered. Silly, really. I suppose he is, technically. No, I meant, um, oh, doesn't matter. Granny Weatherwax and Nanny Og left Goatburger's office and walked demurely down the street. At least Granny walked demurely. Nanny leaned somewhat. Every thirty seconds she'd say, how much was that again? Three thousand two hundred and seventy dollars and eighty-seven pence, said Granny. She was looking thoughtful. I thought it was nice of him to look in all the ashtrays for all the odd coppers he could round up, said Nanny. Those he could reach, anyway. How much was that again? Three thousand two hundred and seventy dollars and eighty-seven pence. I've never had seventy dollars before, said Nanny. I didn't say just seventy dollars. I said... Yes, I know, but I'm working my way up to it, gradual. I say this about money, it really chafes. I don't know why you have to keep your purse in your knicker leg, said Granny. It's the last place anyone would look, Nanny sighed. How much did you say it was? Three thousand two hundred and seventy dollars and eighty-seven pence. I'm going to need a bigger tin. You're going to need a bigger chimney. I could certainly do with a bigger knicker leg, she nudged Granny. You're going to have to be polite to me now. I'm rich, she said. Yes, indeed, said Granny, with a faraway look in her eyes. Don't think I'm not considering that. She stopped. Nanny walked into her with a tinkle of lingerie. 
The frontage of the opera house loomed over them. We've got to get back in there, Granny said, and into box eight. Crawbar, said Nanny firmly, a number three claw end should do it. We are not your nev, said Granny. Anyway, breaking in wouldn't be the same thing. We've got to have a right to be there. Cleaners, said Nanny. We could be cleaners and... No, it's not right me being a cleaner now in my position. No, we can't have that with you in your position. Granny glanced down at Nanny as a coach pulled up outside the opera house. Of course, she said, artfulness dripping off her voice like toffee. We could always buy box eight. Wouldn't work said Nanny. People were hurrying down the steps with the cuff-adjusting, sticky looks of welcoming committees everywhere. They're scared of selling it. Why not, said Granny. There's people dying and the opera goes on. That means someone's prepared to sell his own grandmother if he'd make enough money. It'd cost a fortune anyway, said Nanny. She looked at Granny's triumphant expression and groaned. Oh, as me, I was going to save that money from the old age. She thought for a minute. Anyway, it still wouldn't work. I mean, look at us. We don't look like the right kind of people. Enrico Basilica got out of the coach. But we know the right kind of people, said Granny. Oh, where's me? The shop bell tinkled in a refined tone, as if it were embarrassed to do something as vulgar as ring. It would have much preferred to give a polite cough. This was Aunt Morpork's most prestigious dress shop and one way of telling was the apparent absence of anything so crass as merchandise. The occasional carefully placed piece of expensive material merely hinted at the possibilities available. This was not a shop where things were bought. This was an emporium where you had a cup of coffee and a chat. Possibly as a result of that muted conversation, four or five yards of exquisite fabric would change ownership in some ethereal way, and yet nothing so crass as trade would have taken place. Shop! yelled Nanny. A lady appeared from behind a curtain and observed the visitors quite possibly with her nose. Have you come to the right entrance? she said. Madame Dorning had been brought up to be polite to servants and tradespeople even when they were as scruffy as these two old crows. My friend here wants a new dress, said the dumpier of the two. One of the knobby ones with a train and a padded bum. In black said the thin one. And we wants all the trimmings, said the dumpy one. Little handbag on a string, pair of glasses on a stick, the whole thing. I think perhaps that might be a little more than you're thinking of spending, said Madame Dorning. How much is a little, said the dumpy one. I mean, this is rather a select dress shop. That's why we're here. We don't want rubbish. My name's Nanny Og, and this here is Lady Esmeralda Weatherwax. Madame Dorning regarded Lady Esmeralda quizzically. There was no doubt that the woman had a certain bearing, and she stared like a duchess. From Lancre, said Nanny Og, and she could have a conservatory if she liked, but she doesn't want one. Er, uh, Madame Dorning decided to play along for a while. What? style were you considering? Something knobby, said Nanny Og. I perhaps would like a little more guidance than that. Perhaps you could show us some things, said Lady Esmeralda, sitting down. It's for the opera. Oh, you patronise the opera. Lady Esmeralda patronises everything, said Nanny Og, stoutly. Madame Dorning had a manner peculiar to her class and upbringing. She'd been raised to see the world in a certain way. When it didn't act in that certain way, she wobbled a bit, but like a gyroscope, eventually recovered and went on spinning just as if it had. If civilization were to collapse totally and the survivors were reduced to eating cockroaches, Madame Dorning would still use a napkin and look down on people who ate their cockroaches the wrong way round. I will uh, show you some <laughs> examples. She said, excuse me one moment. She scuttled into the long workrooms behind the shop, where there was considerably less guilt, and leaned against the wall and summoned her chief seamstress. Mildred, there are two very strange... She stopped. They'd followed her. They were wandering down the aisle between the rows of dressmakers, nodding at people and inspecting some of the dresses on the dummies. She hurried back. 
I'm sure you'd prefer... How much is this one? said Lady Esmeralda, fingering a creation intended for the Dowager Duchess of Quirm. I am afraid that one is not for sale. How much would it be if it was for sale? Three hundred dollars, I believe, said Madame Dorning. Five hundred seems about right, said Lady Esmeralda. Does it? said Nanny Og. Oh, it does, does it? The dress was black. At least in theory it was black. It was black in the same way that a starling's wing is black. It was black silk with jet beads and sequins. It was black on holiday. It looks about my size. We'll take it. Pay the woman, Giffa. Madame's gyroscope precessed rapidly. Take it? Now? Five hundred dollars pay? Pay? Now? Cash? See to it, Githa. Oh, all right. Nanny Og turned away modestly and raised her skirt. There was a series of rustlings and elasticated twangings, and then she turned around holding a bag. She counted out fifty rather warm ten-dollar pieces into Madame Dorning's unprotesting hand. And now we'll go back into the shop and have a poke around for the other stuff, said Lady Esmeralda. I fancy ostrich feathers myself, and one of those big cloaks the ladies wear, and one of those fans edged with lace. Why don't we get some great big diamonds while we're about it, said Nanny Og sharply. Good idea. Madame Dorning could hear them bickering as they ambled away up the aisle. She looked down at the money in her hand. She knew about old money, which was somehow hallowed by the fact that people had hung on to it for years, and she knew about new money, which seemed to be being made by all these upstarts that were flooding into the city these days. But under her powdered bosom, she was an Ankh Morpork shopkeeper, and knew that the best kind of money was the sort that was in her hand rather than someone else's. The best kind of money was mine, not yours. Besides, she was also enough of a snob to confuse rudeness with good breeding. In the same way that the really rich can never be mad, they're eccentric, so they can also never be rude. They're outspoken and forthright. She hurried after Lady Esmeralda and her rather strange friend. Salt of the earth, she told herself. She was in time to overhear a mysterious conversation. I'm being punished, ain't I, Esme? Can't imagine what you're talking about, Giffa. Just cos I had my little moment. I really don't follow you. Anyway, you said you were at your wit's end with thinking what you'd do with the money. Yes, but I'd have quite liked to have been at my wit's end on a big comfy chair's long you, somewhere with lots of big strong men buying me chocolates and pressing their favours on me. Money doesn't buy happiness, Giffa. I only wanted to rent it for a few weeks. Agnes rose late, the music still ringing in her ears, and dressed in a dream, but she hung a bedsheet over the mirror just in case. There were half a dozen of the chorus dancers in the canteen sharing a stick of celery and giggling. And there was Andre. He was eating something absent-mindedly while staring at a sheet of music. Occasionally he'd wave his spoon in the air with a faraway look on his face and then put it down and make a few notes. In mid-beat he caught sight of Agnes and grinned. Hello. You look tired. Er, uh, yes. You've missed all the excitement. Have I? The watch have been here, talking to everyone and asking lots of questions and writing things down, very slowly. What sort of questions? Well, knowing the watch, probably, was it you what did it then? They're rather slow thinkers. Oh dear, does that mean tonight's performance is cancelled? Andre laughed. He had a rather pleasant laugh. I don't think Mr Bucket could possibly cancel it, he said, even if people are dropping like flies out of the flies. Why not? People have been queuing for tickets. Why? He told her. That's disgusting, said Agnes. You mean they're coming because it might be dangerous? Human nature, I'm afraid. Of course, some of them want to hear Enrico Basilica and, well, Christine seems popular. He gave her a sorrowful look. I don't mind. Honestly, lied Agnes. Um, how long have you worked here, Andre? Uh, only a few months. I used to teach music to the Seraph's children in Clatch. Um, what do you think about the ghost? He shrugged. Just some kind of madman, I suppose. Uh, do you know if he sings? I mean, he's good at singing. I heard he sends little critiques to the manager. Some of the girls say they've heard someone singing in the night, but they're always saying silly things. 
Um, are there any secret passages here? He looked at her with his head on one side. Who have you been talking to? Sorry? The girls say they are. Of course, they say they see the ghost all the time, and sometimes in two places at once. Why should they see him more? Perhaps he just likes looking at young ladies. They're always practising in odd corners. Besides, they're all half-crazed with hunger anyway. Aren't you interested in the ghost? People have been killed. Well, people are saying it might have been Dr. Undershaft. But he was killed. He might have hanged himself. He'd been very depressed lately, and he'd always been a bit strange. Nervy. It's going to be a bit difficult without him, though. Here, I brought you a stack of old programmes. Some of the notes may help, since you haven't been in the opera long. Agnes stared at them, unseeing. People were disappearing, and the first thought that everyone had was that it was going to be inconvenient without them. The show must go on. Everyone said that. People said it all the time. Often they smiled when they said it. But they were serious all the same, under the smile. No one ever said why. But yesterday, when the chorus had been arguing about the money, everyone knew that they weren't actually going to refuse to sing. It was all a game. The show went on. She'd heard all the stories. She'd heard about shows continuing while fire raged around the city, while a dragon was roosting on the roof, while there was rioting in the streets outside. Scenery collapsed. The show went on. Leading tenor died. Then appeal to the audience for any student of music who knew the part, and give him his big chance while his predecessor's body cooled gently in the wings. Why? It was only a performance, for heaven's sake. It wasn't like something important. But the show goes on. Everyone took this so much for granted that they didn't even think about it anymore, as though there were fog in their heads. On the other hand, someone was teaching her to sing at night. A mysterious person sang songs on the stage when everyone had gone home. She tried to think of that voice belonging to someone who killed people. It didn't work. Maybe she'd caught some of the fog and didn't want it to work. What sort of person could have that feel for music and kill people? End of side nine. Side ten. She'd been idly turning the pages of an old program, and a name caught her eye. She quickly shuffled through the others beneath. There it was again. Not in every performance, and never in a major role, but it was there. Generally, it played an innkeeper or a servant. Walter Plinge, she said. Walter? But he doesn't sing, does he? She held up a programme and pointed. What? Oh, no! Andre laughed. Good heavens! It's, er, um, a kind of convenient name, I suppose. Sometimes someone has to sing a very minor part. Perhaps a singer is in a role that they'd rather not be remembered in. Well, here they just go down on the programme as Walter Plinge. Lots of theatres have a useful name like that, like A.N. Other. It's convenient for everyone. But Walter Plinge? Well, I suppose it started as a joke. I mean, can you imagine Walter Plinge on stage? Andre grinned. In that little beret he wears. What does he think about it? I don't think he minds. It's hard to tell, isn't it? There was a crash from the direction of the kitchen, although it was really more of a crescendo. The long, drawn-out clatter that begins when a pile of plates begins to slip, continues when someone tries to grab at them, develops a desperate counter-theme when the person realises they don't have three hands, and ends with the hoing, hoing, hoing of the one miraculously intact plate spinning round and round on the floor. They heard an irate female voice. Won't up, Linge! Sorry, Mrs. Clamp. Damn thing keeps holding onto the edge of the pan. Let go, you wretched insect! There was the sound of crockery being swept up, and then a rubbery noise that could approximately be described as on Now where's it gone? Don't know, Mrs. Clamp. And what's that cat doing in here? Andre turned back to Agnes and flashed her a sad smile. It is a little cruel, I suppose, he said. The poor chap is a bit daft. I'm not at all sure, said Agnes, that I've met anyone here who isn't. He grinned again. I know, he said. I mean, everyone acts as if it's only the music that matters. The plots don't make sense. Half the stories rely on people not recognising their servants or wives because they've got a tiny mask on. 
Large ladies play the part of consumptive girls. No one can act properly. No wonder everyone accepts me singing for Christine. That's practically normal compared to opera. It's an operatic kind of idea. There should be a sign on the door saying, Leave your common sense here. If it wasn't for the music, the whole thing would be ridiculous. She realised he was looking at her with an opera face. Of course, that's it, isn't it? It is the show that matters, isn't it? She said. It's all show. It's not meant to be real, said Andre. It's not like theatre. No one's saying, you've got to pretend this is a big battlefield and that guy in the cardboard crown is really a king. The plot's only there to fill in time before the next song. He leaned forward and took her hand. This must be wretched for you, he said. No male had ever touched Agnes before, except perhaps to push her over and steal her sweets. She pulled her hand away. I, I, uh, better go and practice, she said, feeling the blush start. You really picked up the role of iodine very well, said Andre. I, uh, have a private tutor, said Agnes. Then he's really studied opera, that's all I can say. I, I think he has. Esme? Yes, Ither? It's not that I'm complaining or anything. Yes, but why isn't it me who's being the posh opera patroniser? Because you're as common as muck, Ither. Oh, right. Nanny subjected this statement to some thought and couldn't see any point of inaccuracy that would sway a jury. Fair enough. It's not as though I like this. Shall I do Madam's feet? said the manicurist. She stared at Granny's boots and wondered if it might be necessary to use a hammer. I got to admit, it's a nice hairstyle, said Nanny. Madam has marvellous hair, said the hairdresser. What is the secret? You've got to make sure there's no newts in the water, said Granny. She looked at her reflection in the mirror over the wash basin and went to look away and then sneaked another glance. Her lips pursed. Oh, she said. At the other end, the manicurist had succeeded in getting Granny's boots and socks off. Much to her amazement, there was revealed, instead of the corned and bungeon monstrosities she'd been expecting, a pair of perfect feet. She didn't know where to start, because there was nowhere to begin. But this manicure was costing twenty dollars, and in those circumstances you damn well find something to do. Nanny sat beside their pile of packages and tried to work everything out on a scrap of paper. She didn't have Granny's gift for numbers. They tended to writhe under her gaze and add themselves up wrong. Esme, I reckon we've spent probably more than a thousand dollars so far, and that's not including hiring the coach, and we haven't paid Mrs. Palm for the room. You said nothing was too much trouble to help a Lankra gal, said Granny. But I didn't say nothing was too much money, thought Nanny, and then scolded herself for thinking like that. But she was definitely feeling a little lighter in the underwear regions. There seemed to be a general consensus among the artisans of beauty that they'd done what they could. Granny swivelled the chair around. What do you think? she said. Nanny Og stared. She'd seen many strange things in her life, some of them twice. She'd seen elves and walking stones and the shoeing of a unicorn. She'd had a farmhouse dropped on her head. But she'd never seen Granny Weatherwax in rouge. All her normal expletives of shock and surprise fused instantly and she found herself resorting to an ancient curse belonging to her grandmother. Well, I'll be mogadored, she said. Madam has extremely good skin, said the cosmetics lady. I know, said Granny, can't seem to do anything about it. I'll be mogadored, said Nanny again. Powder and paint, said Granny. <laughs> Just another kind of mask. Oh well, she gave the hairdresser a dreadful smile. How much do we owe you, she said. Er, uh, thirty dollars, said the hairdresser. That is, give the wo man uh, thirty dollars and another twenty to make up for his trouble, said Granny, clutching at her head. Fifty dollars? You could buy a shop for... Give her... Oh, all right. Excuse me, I'm just going to the bank. She turned away demurely, raised the hem of her skirt, twang, twing, twang, twang, and turned back with a handful of coins. There you go, my good wo... Er... Uh, Sir, she said, sourly. There was a coach waiting outside. It was the best Granny had been able to hire with Nanny's money. A footman held open the door as Nanny helped her friend aboard. 
We'll go straight to Mrs. Palms so as I can change, said Granny as they pulled away, and then to the Opera House. We ain't got much time. Are you all right? Never felt better, Granny patted her hair. Give a og. You wouldn't be a witch if you couldn't jump to conclusions, right? Nanny nodded. Oh, yes. There was no shame in it. Sometimes there wasn't time to do anything else but take a flying leap. Sometimes you had to trust to experience and intuition and general awareness and take a running jump. Nanny herself could clear quite a tall conclusion from a standing start. So I've no doubt at all that there's some kind of idea floating around in your mind about this ghost. Well, sort of an idea, yes. A name, perhaps? Nanny shifted uncomfortably, and not only because of the money bags under her skirt. I've got to admit, something crossed my mind. A kind of feeling. I mean, you never can tell. Granny nodded. Yes. It's all neat, isn't it? It's a lie. You said last night you saw the whole thing. It's still a lie. Like the lie about masks. What lie about masks? The way people say they hide faces. They do hide faces, said Nanioc. Only the one on the outside. No one took much notice of Agnes. The stage was being set for the new performance tonight. The orchestra were rehearsing. The ballerinas had been herded into their practice room. In various other rooms, people were singing at cross purposes. But no one seemed to want her to do anything. I'm just a wandering voice, she thought. She climbed the stairs to her room and sat on the bed. The curtains were still drawn, and in the gloom the strange roses glowed. She had rescued them from the bin because they were beautiful, but in a way she'd have been happier if they weren't there. Then she could have believed she'd imagined the whole thing. There was no sound from Christine's room. Telling herself that it was really her room anyway, and Christine had just been allowed to borrow it, Agnes went in. It was a mess. Christine had got up, got dressed, either that or a thorough but over-enthusiastic burglar had gone through every drawer in the place, and gone. The bouquets that Agnes had put into whatever receptacles she could find last night were where she had left them. The others were where she had left them too, and they were already dying. She caught herself wondering where she could find some jars and pots for them and hated herself for it. It was as bad as saying poot. You might as well paint welcome on yourself and lie down on the doorstep of the universe. It was no fun at all having a wonderful personality. Oh, and good hair. And then she went and found pots for them anyway. The mirror dominated the room. It seemed to grow a little larger each time she looked at it. All right, she had to know, didn't she? Heart pounding, she felt around the edges of it. There was a little raised area that might have looked like part of the frame, but as her fingers moved across it, there was a click, and the mirror swung inwards a fraction of an inch. When she pushed at it, it moved. She breathed out and stepped in. It's disgusting, said Salzella. It's pandering to the most depraved taste. Mr. Bucket shrugged. It's not as though we're putting good chance of seeing someone throttled on stage on the posters, he said. But news has got around. People like drama. You mean the watch didn't want us to shut down? No, they just said we should mount guards like last night and they'd take steps. Steps to the nearest place of safety, no doubt. I don't like it any more than you do, but it's gone too far. We need the watch now. Anyway, there'd be a riot if we closed. Uh, Aunt Moorpork has always enjoyed e excitement. We're completely sold out. The show must go on. Oh, yes, said Salzella nastily. Would you like me to slit a few throats in the second act, just so no one feels disappointed? Of course not, said Bucket. We don't want any deaths. But... The butt hung in the air like the late Dr. Undershaft. Salzella threw up his hands. Anyway, I, I believe we are past the worst, said Mr. Bucket. I hope so, said Salzella. Where's Signor Basilica, said Bucket. Mrs. Plinge is showing him his dressing room. Mrs. Plinge hasn't been murdered? No, no one has been found dead so far today, said Salzella. That is good news. Yes, and it must be, oh, at least ten past twelve, said Salzella with an irony that Bucket quite failed to notice. I will go and fetch him up so that we can have lunch, shall I? It must be a good half an hour since he had a snack. Bucket nodded. After the director had gone, he surreptitiously checked his desk drawers again. 
There was no letter. Perhaps it was over. Perhaps it was true what they were saying about the late doctor. Someone knocked at the door four times. Only one person could achieve four knocks without any rhythm whatsoever. Uh, come in, Walter. Walter Plinge stumbled into the room. There's a lady, he said. She's to see Mr. Bucket. Nanny Og poked her head around the door. Cooey, she said. It's only me. It's、uh, Mrs. Og, isn't it? Said Mr. Bucket. There was something slightly worrying about the woman. He didn't recall her name on the list of employees. On the other hand, she was clearly around the place. She wasn't dead, and she made a decent cup of tea. So was it his worry if she wasn't getting paid? Good gracious! I'm not the lady," said Nanny Og. "I'm as common as muck, me, on the highest authority. No, she's waiting down in the foyer. I thought I'd better nip round here and warn you. Uh, uh, warn me? Warn me about what? I don't have any other appointments this morning. Uh, uh, um, who is this lady? Have you ever heard of Lady Esmeralda Weatherwax? Um, no. Should I? Famous patron of the opera, conservatories all over the place," said Nanny. "Pots of money too. Uh, really? But I'm due to."、Uh... Bucket looked out of the window. There was a coach and four horses outside. It had so much rococo ornamentation on it that it was surprising it ever managed to move. Well, I、um, he began again. It is really very incon.、Uh, mm. She ain't the sort of person who likes to be kept waiting," said Nanny with absolute honesty. And then, because Granny had been getting on her nerves all morning, and the initial embarrassment at Mrs. Palm's still rankled, and there was a streak of mischief in Nanny a mile wide, she added, "They say she was a famous courtesan in her younger days. They say she didn't like to be kept waiting then either. Retired now, of course. So they say." You know, I, I, I visited most of the major opera houses, and I never heard that name," mused Bucket. "Ah, I heard she likes to keep her donations secret," said Nanny. Mister Bucket's mental compass once again swung around to point due money. "You'd better show her up," he said. "I could perhaps give her a few minutes." "No one ever gave Lady Esmeralda less than half an hour," said Nanny, and gave Bucket a wink. I'll go and fetch her, shall I? She bustled away, towing Walter behind her. Mister Bucket stared after her. Then, after a moment's thought, he got up and checked the set of his moustache in the mirror over the fireplace. He heard the door open and turned with his finest smile in place. It faded only slightly at the sight of Salzella ushering the impressive bulk of Basilica in front of him. The little manager and interpreter fussed along beside him like a tugboat. Ah, oh,、uh, Signor Basilica," said Bucket. "I trust the、uh, dressing rooms are to your satisfaction." Basilica gave him a blank smile while the interpreter spoke in Brindisian and then replied, "Signor Basilica says they are fine, but the larder isn't big enough." He said, "Ah," <laughs> said Bucket, and then stopped when no one else laughed. In 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 fact. He said hurriedly, "Signor Basilica will, will, I'm sure, be very happy to hear that our kitchens have made a special effort to." There was another knock at the door. He hurried across and opened it. Granny Weatherwax stood there, but not for long. She pushed him aside and swept into the room. There was a choking noise from Enrico Basilica. "Which one of you is Bucket?" she demanded. Uh, uh, "Uh, me." Granny removed a glove and extended her hand. So sorry," she said. "I am not used to important people opening their own doors. I am Hesmerilda Weatherwax. <laughs> How charming! I've, I've I've heard so much about you," lied Bucket. "Pray let me introduce you. No doubt you know Signor Basilica." "Of course," said Granny, looking Henry Slug in the eye. "I'm sure Signor Basilica recalls the many happy times we've had in other opera houses whose names I can't quite remember at the moment." Henry grimaced a smile and said something to the interpreter. "That is astonishing," said the interpreter. "Signor Basilica has just said how fondly he recalls meeting you many times before at opera houses that have just slipped his mind at present." 
Henry kissed Granny's hand and looked up at her with pleading in his eyes. My word, thought Bucket, that look he's giving her. I wonder if they ever... Oh, uh, and, and, and this is uh, Mr. Salzella, our, our director of music, he said, remembering himself. Honoured, said Salzella, giving Granny a firm handshake and looking her squarely in the eye. She nodded. And what's the first thing you'd take out of a burning house, Mr. Salzilla? she inquired. He smiled politely. Uh, what would you like me to take, madam? She nodded thoughtfully and let go of his hand. May I <laughs> get you a drink, said Bucket. A small sherry, said Granny. Salzella sidled up to Bucket as he was pouring the drink. Who the hell is she? Apparently she's a... Uh, She's a rolling in money, whispered Bucket, and very keen on opera. Never heard of her. Well, Senior Basilica has, and that's good enough for me. Make yourself pleasant to them, will you, while I try to sort out lunch. He pulled open the door and tripped over Nanny Og. Sorry, said Nanny, standing up and giving him a cheerful grin. These doorknobs are a bugger to polish, aren't they? Uh, Mrs. Uh, Og. Og, could you run along to the kitchens and tell Mrs. Clamp there will be another one for lunch, please? Right you are. Nanny bustled away. Bucket nodded approvingly. What a reliable old lady, he thought. It wasn't exactly a secret. When the room had been divided, a space had been left between the walls. At the far end it opened onto a staircase, a perfectly ordinary staircase, which even had some grubby daylight via a dirt-encrusted window. Agnes was vaguely disappointed. She had expected, well, a real secret passage, perhaps with a few torches flickering secretly in rather valuable secret wrought iron holders. But the staircase had just been walled off from the rest of the place at some time. It wasn't secret. It had merely been forgotten. There were cobwebs in the corners. The cocoons of extinct flies hung down from the ceiling. The air smelled of long dead birds. But there was a clear track through the dust. Someone had used the stairs several times. She hesitated between up and down, and headed up. That was no great journey. After one more flight it ended at a trapdoor that wasn't even bolted. She pushed at it, and then blinked in the unaccustomed light. Wind caught at her hair. A pigeon stared at her, and flew away as she poked her head into the fresh air. The door had opened out onto the Opera House's roof. Just one more item in a forest of skylights and air shafts. She went back inside and headed downwards, and became aware, as she did so, of the voices. The old stairs hadn't been totally forgotten. Someone had at least seen their usefulness as an air shaft. Voices filtered up. There were scales, distant music, snatches of conversation. As she went down, she passed through layers of noise, like a very carefully made Sunday of sound. Grebo sat on top of the kitchen cupboard and watched the performance with interest. Use the ladle, why don't you? said a scene shifter. It won't reach, Walter. Yes, Mrs. Clamp. Give me that broom. Yes, Mrs. Clamp. Grebo looked up at the high ceiling, to which was affixed a sort of thin, ten-pointed star. In the middle of it was a pair of very frightened eyes. Plunge it into boiling water said Mrs. Clamp. That's what it said in the cookbook. It never said, watch out, it'll grip the sides of the pot and spring straight up in the air. She flailed around with the broom handle. The squid shrank back. And that pasta's all gone wrong, she muttered. I've had it grilling for hours and it's still hard as nails. The wretched stuff. Cooey, it's only me, said Nanny Og, poking her head around the door. And such was the all-embracing nature of her personality that even those who didn't know who she was took this on trust. Having a bit of trouble, are you? She surveyed the scene, including the ceiling. There was a smell of burning pasta in the air. Ah, she said, this would be the special lunch for Signor Basilica, would it? It was meant to be, said the cook, still making ineffectual swipes. Blasted thing won't come down, though. Other pots were simmering on the long iron range. Nanny nodded towards them. What's everyone else having, she said. Mutton and clouty dumplings with slum pie, said the cook. Ah, good honest food, said Nanny, speaking of wall-to-wall -wall suet oiled with lard. And there's supposed to be jammy devils for pudding, and I've been so tied up with this wretched thing I haven't even made a start. Nanny carefully took the broom out of the cook's hands. Tell you what, 
she said. You make enough dumplings and slum pie for five people, and I'll help by knocking up a quick pudding. How about that? Well, that's a very handsome offer, Mrs. Og. The jam's in the jar, but... Oh, I won't bother about jam, said Nanny. She looked at the spice rack, grinned, and then stepped behind a table for modesty. Twing, twang, twong, twang. Got any chocolate? she said, producing a slim volume. I've got a recipe right here that might be fun. She licked her thumb and opened the book at page 53. Chocolate delight with special secret sauce. Yes, thought Nanny, that would be fun. If people wanted to go around teaching people lessons, other people should remember that those people knew a thing or two about people. Scraps of conversation floated out of the walls as Agnes wound her secret way down the forgotten stairs. It was thrilling. No one was saying anything important. There were no convenient guilty secrets. There were just the sounds of people getting through the day. But they were secret sounds. It was wrong to listen, of course. Agnes had been brought up in the knowledge that a lot of things were wrong. It was wrong to listen at doors, to look people directly in the eye, to talk out of turn, to answer back, to put yourself forward. But behind the walls, she could be the Perdita she'd always wanted to be. Perdita didn't care about anything. Perdita got things done. Perdita could wear anything she wanted. Perdita X knit. Mistress of the darkness, Magdalene of cool, could listen in to other people's lives and never, ever have to have a wonderful personality. Agnes knew she should go back up to her room. Whatever lay in the increasingly shadowy depths was probably something she ought not to find. Perdita continued downwards. Agnes went along for the ride. The pre-luncheon drinks were going quite well, Mr. Bucket thought. Everyone was making polite conversation, and absolutely no one had been killed up to the present moment. And it had been very gratifying to see the tears of gratitude in Signor Basilica's eyes when he was told that the cook was preparing a special Brindisian meal just for him. He seemed quite overcome. It was reassuring that he knew Lady Esmeralda. There was something about the woman that left Mr. Bucket terribly perplexed. He was finding it a little difficult to converse with her. As a conversational gambit, hello, I understand you have a lot of money, can I have some, please, lacked, he felt, a certain subtlety. Uh, um, so, uh, <laughs> madam, he ventured, what uh, uh, brings you to our um, city? I thought perhaps I could come and spend some money, said Granny. Got rather a lot of it, you know. <laughs> Keep having to change banks because they get filled up. Somewhere in Bucket's tortured brain, part of his mind went whoopee and clicked its heels. Ah, I'm sure if there's uh, anything I can do, he murmured. As a matter of fact, they're his, said Granny. I was thinking of... A gong banged. Ah, said Mr. Bucket. Ah, uh, luncheon is, is served. He extended his arm to Granny, who gave it an odd look before remembering who she was and taking it. There was a small, exclusive dining room off his office. It contained a table set for five, and looking rather fetching in a waitress's lacy bonnet, Nanny Og. She bobbed a curtsy. Enrico Basilica made a tiny strangling noise at the back of his throat. Oh, excuse me, there's been a bit of a problem, said Nanny. Who's dead? said Bucket. Oh, no one's dead, said Nanny. It's the dinner. It's still alive and hanging on to the ceiling. And the pasta's gone all black, see? I said to Mrs. Clamp, I said, it may be foreign, but I don't reckon it should be crunchy. This is terrible. Uh, what a way to treat an honoured guest, said Bucket. He turned to the interpreter. Please, uh, <laughs> assure Signor Basilica that we will send out for fresh pasta straight away. Uh, what were we having, Mrs. Og? Roast mutton with cloutie dumplings, said Nanny. Behind the face of Signor Basilica, the throat of Henry Slug made another little growling sound. And there's some nice slum pie with a knob of butter, Nanny went on. Bucket looked around, puzzled. Uh, is there a dog somewhere in here? he said. Well, I for one don't believe in pandering to singers, said Granny Weatherwax. Fancy food indeed. I never heard the like. Why not give him mutton with the rest of us? Oh, uh, uh, Lady Esmeralda, that's, uh, 
hardly a way to treat... Uh, Bucket began. Enrico's elbow nudged his interpreter, with the special nudge of a man who could see Clooty dumplings vanishing into the long grass if he weren't careful. He rumbled out a very pointed sentence. Signor Basilica says he would be more than happy to taste the indigenous food of Ankh Morpork, said the interpreter. No, we, we, we really can't, Bucket tried again. In fact, Signor Basilica insists that he tries the indigenous food of Ankh Morpork, said the interpreter. Is a right? See, si, said Basilica. Good, said Granny, and give him some beer while you're about it. She gave the tenor's stomach a playful poke, losing her finger down to the second joint. Why, in a day or two I expect you could practically turn him into a native. <laughs> the wooden stairs gave way to stone. Perdita said, He'll have a vast cave somewhere under the opera house. There will be hundreds of candles casting an exciting yet romantic light over the, yes, the lake, and there will be a dinner table shining with crystal glass and silverware, and of course he will have, yes, a huge organ. Agnes blushed hotly in the darkness, on which, that is to say, he will play in a virtuoso style many operatic classics. Agnes said, it'll be damp, there'll be rats. Another clouty dumpling, senior? said Nanny Og. Mm, mm. Take two while you're about it. It was an education watching Enrico Basilica eat. It wasn't as though he gobbled his food, but he did eat continuously, like a man who intends to go on doing it all day on industrial lines, his napkin tucked neatly into his collar. The fork was loaded while the current consignment was being thoroughly masticated, so that the actual time between mouthfuls was as small as possible. Even Nanny, no stranger to a metabolism going for the burn, was impressed. Enrico Basilica ate like a man freed at last from the tyranny of tomatoes with everything. I'll order another mint sauce tanker, shall I? she said. Mr. Bucket turned to Granny Weatherwax. I you were saying that uh, you, you might be inclined to patronise our opera house, he murmured. Oh, yes, said Granny. Is a senior basilica going to sing tonight? <laughs> I hope so, muttered Salzella. That will explode. Then I shall definitely want to be there, said Granny. A little more lamb here, my good woman. Yes, ma'am said Nanny Og, making a face at the back of Granny's head. Uh, uh, seats for tonight are, are, are in fact, uh, Bucket began. A box would do me, said Granny. I'm not fussy. In fact, even the box is a... Uh... How about box eight? I've heard as box eight is always empty. Bucket's knife rattled on his plate. Um, box eight. <laughs> box eight. Uh, well, you see, we, we don't... Um, I was thinking of donating a little something, said Granny. But uh, b -b 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 box eight, you see, although technically unsold, two thousand dollars was what I had in mind, said Granny. Oh dear me, your waitress has let her dumplings go all over the place. It's so difficult to get reliable and polite staff these days, ain't it? Salzella and Bucket stared at one another across the table. Then Bucket said, Excuse me, my lady, I must just have a brief discussion with my director of music. The two men hurried to the far end of the room where they began to argue in whispers. Two thousand dollars, hissed Nanny, watching them. It might not be enough, said Granny. They're both looking very red in the face. Yes, but two thousand dollars? It's only money. Yes, but it's only my money. Not only your money, Nanny pointed out. We witches have always held everything in common, you know that, said Granny. Well, yes, said Nanny, and once again cut to the heart of the socio-political debate. It's easy to hold everything in common when no one's got anything. Why, Githa Og, said Granny, I thought you despised riches. Right, so I'd like to get the chance to despise them up class. But I knows you, Githa Og, money'd spoil you. I'd just like the chance to prove that it wouldn't. That's all I'm saying. Hush, they're coming back. End of side ten.
Side 11. Mr. Bucket approached, smiled uneasily, and sat down. Ah, uh, <clears throat> he began. It uh, has to be box eight, does it? Only we could perhaps persuade someone in one of the other... <laughs> Wouldn't hear of it, said Granny. I've heard that there's no one ever seen in box eight. <laughs> it's uh, laughable, I know, but there are some um, old theatrical traditions associated with Box 8. Absolute rubbish, of course. <laughs> but he left the butt hanging there, hopefully. It froze in the face of Granny's stare. You see, it's um, haunted, he mumbled. Oh, lorks, said Nanny Og, vaguely remembering to stay in character. Another vat of slumpies in your basilica? And how about another quart of beer? Mmm, <coughs> said the tenor encouragingly, taking time out from his eating to point a fork at his empty mug. Granny went on staring. Excuse me, said Bucket again. He and Salzella went into another huddle, out of which came sounds like, But two thousand dollars, that's a lot of shoes. Bucket surfaced again. His face was grey. Granny's stare could do that to people. Um, uh, um, because of the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, danger, uh, which of course doesn't exist, <laughs> we, uh, that is the uh, management, feel it incumbent on us to insist, that is, politely request, that if you do enter Box 8, you do so in company with, 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 um, with, with a man. He ducked slightly. A man, said Granny, for, for, for protection, said Bucket, in a little voice. Although who'd protect him, we really couldn't say, said Salzella, under his breath. We, we, we thought perhaps we were one of the staff, Bucket mumbled. I am quite capable of finding my own man, should the need arise, said Granny, in a voice with snow on it. Bucket's polite reply died in his throat when he saw just behind Lady Esmeralda Mrs. Ogg grinning like a full moon. Anyone for pudding, she said. She held a big bowl on a tray. There seemed to be a heat haze over it. My word, he said. That looks delicious. Enrico Basilica looked over the top of his food with the expression of a man who has had the amazing privilege of going to heaven while still alive. <coughs> it was damp, and with the demise of Mr. Pounder, there were indeed rats. The stone looked old, too. Of course, all stone was old, Agnes told herself, but this had grown old as masonry. Ark Morpork had been there for thousands of years. Where other cities were built on clay or rock or loam, Ark Morpork was built on Ark Morpork. People constructed new buildings on the remains of earlier ones, knocking out a few doorways here and there to turn ancient bedrooms into cellars. The stairs petered out on damp flagstones in almost total darkness. Perdita thought it looked romantic and gothic. Agnes thought it looked gloomy. If someone used this place, they'd need lights, wouldn't they? And a fumbling search confirmed it. She found a candle and some matches tucked into a niche in the wall. That was sobering for Agnes and Perdita together. Someone used this prosaic book of matches with a picture of a grinning troll on the cover and this piece of perfectly ordinary candle. Perdita would have preferred a flaming torch. Agnes didn't know what she would have preferred. It was just that if a mysterious person came and sang in the walls and moved around the place like a ghost and possibly killed people, well, you'd prefer a bit more style than a box of matches with the picture of a grinning troll on it. That was the sort of thing a murderer would use. She lit the candle and, in two minds about it all, went on into the dark. Chocolate Delight with Special Secret Sauce was a great success, and heading down the little red lane as though hot-wired. More, Mr. Salzella, said Bucket. This really is first-class stuff, isn't it? I, I must congratulate Mrs. Clamp. There is a certain piquancy, I must say, said the director of music. How about you, Signor Basilica? Mm -hmm. Lady Esmeralda? I don't mind if I do, said Granny, passing her plate across. I'm sure I detect a hint of cinnamon, said the interpreter, a brown ring around his mouth. Indeed, and, 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 and possibly just a, a trace of nutmeg, said Mr. Bucket. 
I thought cardamom, said Salzella. Creamy, yet, yet spicy, said Bucket, his eyes unfocused slightly, a and curiously warming. Granny stopped chewing and looked down suspiciously at her plate. And then she sniffed at her spoon. Is it, uh, is it, is it just me, or, or, or is it a trifle <laughs> uh, warm in here, said Bucket. Salzella had gripped the arms of his chair. His forehead glistened. Do you think we could open a uh, window, he said. I feel a little strange. Yes, by all means, said Bucket. Salzella half rose, and then a preoccupied expression suffused his features. He sat down suddenly. No, I, I rather believe I'll just sit quietly for a moment, he said. Oh dear, said the interpreter. There was a hint of vapour around his collar. The silica tapped him politely on the shoulder, grunted hopefully, and made pass it here motions in the direction of the half-finished dish of chocolate pudding. Mm hmm he said. Oh dear, said the interpreter. Mr. Bucket ran a finger around his collar. Sweat was beginning to roll down his face. Basilica gave up on his stricken colleague and reached across in a business-like way to hook the dish with his fork. Uh, 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 yes, said Bucket, trying to keep his eyes away from Granny. Yes, indeed, said Salzella, his voice coming from a long way away. Oh, dear, said the interpreter, his eyes watering. I'm this dear meal, or gotten sick Signor Basilica upended the rest of the special secret sauce onto his plate and carefully scraped out the dish with his spoon, holding it upside down to reach the last little bit. The weather has been a, a little oh, cool of late, Bucket managed. Very, very cold, in fact. Enrico held the sauce dish up to the light and regarded it critically in case there was any drop hiding in a corner. Snow, ice, frost, that sort of thing, said Salzella. Yes, indeed. Coldness of all descriptions, in fact. Yes, yes, said Bucket gratefully. And at a time like this, I think it is very, very important to uh, remember the names of, say, any number of boring and hopefully chilly things. Wind, glaciers, icicles. No, oh, n not icicles. Oh, said the interpreter and slumped forward into his plate. His head hit a spoon, which cartwheeled into the air and bounced off Enrico's head. Salzella started to whistle under his breath and pound the arm of his chair. Bucket blinked. In front of him was the water jug. The cold water jug. He reached out. Oh, 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 oh dear me, what can I say? I, I, I seem to have spilled it all over myself, he said, through the rising clouds of steam. What, what a butt of fingers I am, to be sure. I, I, I shall ring for Mrs. Og <laughs> to bring us another one. Yes, indeed, said Salzella, and perhaps you would care to do it soon? I am also feeling very accident-prone. Basilica, still chewing, lifted his interpreter's head off the table and carefully tipped the man's unfinished pudding into his own plate. In fact, in fact, in fact, said Salzella, I think I shall just have a brisk, a nice cold. <clears throat> if you would excuse me a minute. He pushed back his chair and fled the room in a kind of crouching gait. Mr. Bucket glistened. I'll just, um, I'll just, <laughs> I'll just uh, be back quite shortly, he said, and scurried away. There was silence, broken only by the scrape of Signor Basilica's spoon and a sizzling noise from the interpreter. Then the tenor belched baritone. Whoops! Oh, <clears throat> pardon my clatchian, he said. Oh, damn! He appeared to notice the depleted table for the first time. He shrugged and smiled hopefully at Granny. <sighs> Is there a cheese board, do you think? he said. The door flew open and Nanny Og burst in, holding a bucket of water in both hands. All right, all right, that's... she began and then stopped. Granny dabbed primly at the corners of her mouth with her napkin. I'm sorry, Mrs. Og, she said. Nanny looked at the empty dish in front of Basilica. Oh! Or perhaps some, some fruit, said the tenor. A few nuts. How much has he had? She whispered. Best part of half, said Granny, but I don't reckon it's having any effect on account of not touching the sides. Nanny turned her attention to Granny's plate. How about you? She said. Two helpings, said Granny, with extra sauce, 
Skitha Og, may you be forgiven. Nanny looked at her with something like admiration in her eyes. You ain't even sweating, she said. Granny picked up her water glass and held it at arm's length. After a few seconds, the water began to boil. All right, you're getting really good, I've got to admit it, said Nanny. I reckon I should have to get up real early to put one over on you. I reckon you should never go to sleep, said Granny. Sorry, Esme. Signor Basilica, at a loss to follow the conversation, realised with reluctance that the meal was probably over. Eh, absolutely superb, he said. Eh, I just love that pudding, Mrs Ogg. I should just jolly well expect you did, Henry Slug, said Nanny. Henry carefully removed a clean handkerchief from his pocket, put it over his face, and leaned back in his chair. The first snore occurred a few seconds later. He's easy to have around, isn't he? said Nanny. Eat, sleep, and sing. You certainly know where you are with him. I found Greebore, by the way. He's still following Walter Plinge around. Her expression became a little defiant. Say what you like, young Walter's all right by me if Greebore likes him. Granny sighed. Get her. Grebo would like Norris the eyeball-eating maniac of Quirm if he knew how to put food in a bowl. And now she was lost. She'd done her best not to be. As Agnes had walked through each dank room, she'd thoughtfully taken note of details. She'd carefully remembered right and left turns. And yet she was lost. Here and there were steps down to lower cellars, but the water level was so high that it was lapping at the first step, and it stank. The candle burned with a greenish-blue edge to the flame. Somewhere, said Perdita, there was the secret room. If there wasn't a huge and glittering secret cavern, what on earth was life for? There had to be a secret room, a room full of giant candles and enormous stalagmites. But it certainly isn't here, said Agnes. She felt a complete idiot. She'd gone through the mirror looking for... Well, she wasn't quite prepared to admit what she might have been looking for, but whatever it was, it certainly wasn't this. She'd have to shout for help. Of course, someone might hear, but that was always a risk when you shouted for help. She coughed. Ahem. <clears throat> uh, hello? The water gurgled. Uh, help? Is there anyone there? A rat ran over her foot. Oh, yes, she thought bitterly, with Perdita's part of her brain. If Christine had come down here, there probably would have been some great glistening cave and delicious danger. The world saved up rats and smelly cellars for Agnes, because she had such a wonderful personality. Um, anyone? More rats scuttled across the floor. There was a faint squeaking from the side passages. Hello? She was lost in some cellars, with the candle getting shorter by the second. The air was foul, the flagstones were slippery, no one knew where she was. She could die down here, she could be... Eyes glowed in the darkness. One was green-yellow, the other pearly white. A light appeared behind them. Something was coming along the passageway, casting long shadows. Rats tumbled over themselves in their panic to get away. Agnes tried to press herself into the stone. Hello, Miss Perdita X Knit. A familiar shape juddered out of the darkness just behind Grebo. It was all knees and elbows. It carried a sack over one shoulder and held a lantern in its other hand. Something fled from the darkness. The terror leached out of it. You don't want to be down here, Miss Knit, with all the rats. Walter. Got to do Mr. Pounder's job now. The poor man has passed away. I am a person of all jobs. No peas for the wicked. But Mr. Grebo just hits them with his paws and they're off to rat heaven in a jiff. Walter, repeated Agnes out of sheer relief. Come for an explore, have you? These old tunnels goes all the way to the river. You have to keep your wits about you not to get lost down here. Want to come back with me? It was impossible to be frightened of Walter Plinge. Walter attracted a number of emotions, but terror wasn't among them. Uh, yes, said Agnes. I got lost. Sorry. Grebo sat down and started to wash himself in what Agnes considered to be a supercilious way. If a cat could snigger, he would be sniggering. 
Now I've got a full sack, I have to take it to Mr Gimlet's shop, announced Walter, turning around and loping out of the cellar without bothering to see if she was following him. We get a halfpenny each which is not to be sneezed at. The dwarfs think a rat is a good meal which only goes to show it would be a strange world if we were all alike. It seemed a ridiculously short journey to the foot of some different stairs, which had a well-used look to them. "'Have you ever seen the ghost, Walter?' said Agnes, as Walter put his foot on the first step. He didn't turn around. "'It is wrong to tell lies.' "'Er, uh, yes, so I believe. So when did you last see the ghost?' "'I last saw the ghost in the big room in the ballet school.' "'Really? What did he do?' Walter paused for a moment, and then the words came out altogether. He ran off! He stamped up the stairs in a way that suggested very emphatically that the exchange was over. Grebo sneered at Agnes and followed him. The stairs went up just one flight and came out through a trapdoor backstage. She had been lost only a door or two from the real world. No one noticed her emerge, but then no one noticed her at all. They just assumed that she'd be around when she was needed. Walter Plinge had already loped off in something of a hurry. Agnes hesitated. They probably wouldn't even notice she wasn't there, right up to the point when Christine opened her mouth. He hadn't wanted to answer, but Walter Plinge spoke when spoken to, and she had a feeling that he wasn't able to lie. Telling lies would be being bad. She'd never seen the ballet school. It wasn't far backstage, but it was a world of its own. The dancers issued from it every day like so many very thin and twittering sheep under the control of elderly women who looked as though they breakfasted on pickled limes. It was only after she'd timidly asked a few questions of the stagehands that she'd realised that the girls had joined the ballet because they'd wanted to. She had seen the dancers' dressing room, where thirty girls washed and changed in a space rather smaller than Bucket's office. It bore the same relationship to ballet as compost did to roses. She looked around again. Still no one had paid any attention to her. She headed for the school. It was up a few steps, along a fetid corridor lined with notice boards and smelling of ancient grease. A couple of girls fluttered past. You never saw just one. They went around in groups like mayflies. She pushed open the door and stepped into the school. Reflections of reflections of reflections. There were mirrors on every wall. A few girls, practising on the bars that lined the room, looked up as she entered. Mirrors. Out in the passage, she leaned against the wall and got her breath back. She'd never liked mirrors. They always seemed to be laughing at her. But didn't they say it was a mark of a witch not liking to get between two mirrors? It sucked out your soul or something? A witch would never get between two mirrors if she could help it. But of course, she very definitely wasn't a witch. So she took a deep breath and went back into the room. Images of herself stretched away in every direction. She managed a few steps, then wheeled around and groped for the doorway again, watched by the surprised dancers. Lack of sleep, she told herself and general over-excitement. Anyway, she didn't need to go right into the room, now that she knew who the ghost was. It was so obvious. The ghost didn't require any mysterious non-existent caves, when all he needed to do was hide where everyone could see him. Mr. Bucket knocked at the door of Salzella's office. A muffled voice said, Come in. There was no one in the office, but there was another closed door in the far wall. Bucket knocked again and then rattled the door handle. I'm in the bath, said Salzilla. Are you decent? I'm fully clothed, if that's what you mean. Is there a pail of ice out there? Was it you who ordered it? said Bucket guiltily. Yes. Only I, uh, <laughs> I had it taken into my office so I could uh, stick my feet in it. Your feet? Yes, uh, I went for a brisk run around the city. <laughs> Don't know why. Just felt like it. Well, my boots, um, well caught fire on the second lap. There was a sloshing noise and some sotto voce grumbling, and then the door swung open, revealing Salzella in a purple dressing gown. Has Signor Basilica been safely tethered? he said, dripping on the floor. He's going through the music with her trouble marker. And he's uh, all right? He uh, sent along to the kitchen for a snack. Salzella shook his head. Astonishing! And they put the interpreter in a cupboard. They don't seem to be able to get him unfolded. Bucket sat down carefully. He was wearing carpet slippers. And 
Salzella prompted. Uh, and what? Where did that dreadful woman go? Mrs. Ogg is, is showing her round. Well, what else could I do? I mean, Two thousand dollars, remember? I am endeavouring to forget, said Salzella. I promise never to talk about that lunch ever again, if you don't either. <laughs> what lunch? said Bucket innocently. Well done. She does seem to have an amazing effect, though, doesn't she? I don't know who you're talking about. I mean, it's not hard to see how she made her money. Good heavens, man, she's got a face like a hatchet. They say that Queen Azariel of Clatch had a squint, but that didn't stop her having fourteen husbands. And that was only the official score. Besides, she's knocking on a bit. I thought she'd been dead for two hundred years. Oh, I'm talking about Lady Esmeralda. So am I. At least uh, try to be civil to her at the soiree before the performance tonight. I'll try. The two thousand might only be the start, I hope. Every time I open a drawer, there are more bills. We seem to owe money to everyone. Opera is expensive. You are telling me. Whenever I try to make a start on the book, something dreadful happens. Do you think I might just have a few hours without something awful happening? In an opera house? The voice was muffled by the half-dismantled mechanism of the organ. All right, give me a middle C. A hairy finger pressed a key. It made a thudding noise, and somewhere in the mechanism something else went boing. Blast, it's come off the peg. Hold on, try again. The note rang out, sweet and clear. OK, said the voice of the man hidden in the exposed entrails of the organ. Wait until I tighten the peg. Agnes stepped closer. The hulking figure seated at the organ turned around and gave her a friendly grin, which was much wider than the average grin. Its owner was covered in red hair, and while short-changed in the leg department, had obviously been the first in the queue when the arm counter opened, and had also been given a special free offer of lip. Andre, said Agnes weakly. The organist extracted himself from the mechanism. He was holding a complicated wooden bar with springs on it. Oh, hello, he said. Uh, who's this? said Agnes, backing away from the primeval organist. Oh, this is the librarian. I don't think he has a name. He's the librarian at Unseen University, but much more importantly, he's their organist. And it turns out, our organ is a Johnson, just like theirs. Burkholk Stutley, bloody stupid Johnson, was Ankh-Morpork's most famous, or rather, most notorious inventor. He was renowned for never letting his number blindness, his lack of any skill whatsoever, or his complete failure to grasp the essence of a problem stand in the way of his cheerful progress as the first counter-Renaissance man. Shortly after building the famous collapsed Tower of Quirm, he turned his attention to the world of music, particularly large organs and mechanical orchestras. Examples of his handiwork still occasionally come to light in sales, auctions, and quite frequently wreckage. He's given us some spare parts. Oh, sorry, uh, lent us some spare parts. He plays the organ in an amazingly prehensile way, yes. Agnes relaxed. The creature didn't seem about to attack. Oh, she said. Well, I suppose it's natural, because sometimes barrel organ men came to our village and they often had a dear little monk who was a crashing cord. The orangutan raised its other hand and waved a finger politely in front of Agnes's face. He doesn't like being called a monkey, said Andre, and he likes you. How can you tell? He doesn't usually go in for warnings. She stepped back quickly and grabbed the boy's arm. Can I have a word with you, she said. We've only got a few hours and I'd really like to get this. It's important. He followed her into the wings. Behind them, the librarian tapped a few keys on the half-repaired keyboard and then ducked underneath. I know who the ghost is, whispered Agnes. Andre stared at her. Then he pulled her further into the shadows. The ghost isn't anybody, he said softly. Don't be silly. It's just the ghost. I mean, he's someone else when he takes his mask off. Who? Should I tell Mr. Bucket and Mr. Salzella? Who? Tell them about who? Walter Plinge. He stared at her again. If you laugh, I'll, I'll kick you, said Agnes. But Walter isn't even... 
I didn't believe it either, but he said he saw the ghost in the ballet school, and there's mirrors all over the walls, and he'd be quite tall if he stood up properly, and he roams around in the cellars. Oh, come on. The other night I thought I heard him singing on the stage when everyone else had gone. You saw him? It was dark. Oh, well, Andre began dismissively. But afterwards I'm certain I heard him talking to the cat. Talking normally, I mean. I mean like a normal person, I mean. And you've got to admit, he is strange. Isn't he just the sort of person who'd want to wear a mask to hide who he is? She sagged. Look, I can see you don't want to listen. No, no, I, I think, well, I just thought I'd feel better if I told someone. Andre smiled in the gloom. I wouldn't mention it to anyone else, though. Agnes looked down at her feet. I suppose it does sound a bit far-fetched. Andre laid a hand on her arm. Perdita felt Agnes draw herself back. Do you feel better, he said. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I just can't imagine him hurting anyone. I feel so stupid. Everyone's on edge. Don't worry about it. I'd hate you to think I was being silly. I'll keep an eye on Walter if you like, he smiled at her. But I'd better get on with things, he added. He gave her another smile, as fast and brief as summer lightning. Thank you. He was already walking back to the organ. This shop was a gentleman's outfitter's. It's not for me, said Nanny Og. It's for a friend. He's six foot tall, very broad shoulders. Inside leg? Oh, yes. She looked around the store. Might as well go all the way. It was her money after all. Under black coat, long black tights, shoes with them shiny buckles, one of those top hats, a big cloak with a red silk lining, a bow tie, a really posh black cane with a very knobby silver knob on it, and uh, a black eye patch. An eye patch? Yes, maybe with sequins or something on it, since it's the opera. The tailor stared at Nanny. This is a little irregular, he said. Why can't the gentleman come in himself? He ain't quite a gentleman yet. But, madam, I meant that we have to get the size right. Nanny Og looked around the shop. Tell you what, she said, you sell me something that looks about right and will adjust him to fit. Excuse me, she turned away demurely, twing, twang, twong, and turned back, smoothing down her dress and holding a leather bag. How much will it be, she said. The tailor looked blankly at the bag. I'm afraid we won't be able to have all that ready until at least next Wednesday, he said. Nanny Og sighed. She felt she was becoming familiar with one of the most fundamental laws of physics. Time equaled money. Therefore, money equaled time. I was sort of hoping to get it all a bit quicker than that, she said, jingling the bag up and down. The tailor looked down his nose at her. We are craftsmen, madam. How long did you think it should take? How about ten minutes? Twelve minutes later, she left the shop with a large packet under one arm, a hat box under the other, and an ebony cane between her teeth. Granny was waiting outside. Got it all? Yes. I'll take the eye patch, shall I? We've got to get a third witch, said Nanny, trying to rearrange the parcels. Young Agnes has got good, strong arms. You know, if we were to drag her out of there by the scruff of her neck, we'd never hear the last of it, said Granny. She'll be a witch when she wants to be. They headed for the opera house's stage door. Afternoon, Les, said Nanny cheerfully as they entered. Stop itching now, has it? Marvellous bit of ointment that was you gave me, Mrs. Ogg, said the stage doorkeeper, his moustache bending into something that might have been a smile. Mrs. Les keeping well? How's her sister's leg? Doing very well, Mrs. Ogg. Thank you for asking. This is just Esme Weatherwax, who's helping me with some stuff, said Nanny. The doorkeeper nodded. It was clear that any friend of Mrs. Ogg was a friend of his. No trouble at all, Mrs. Ogg. As they passed through into the dusty network of corridors, Granny reflected, not for the first time, that Nanny had a magic all of her own. Nanny didn't so much enter places as insinuate herself. She had unconsciously taken a natural talent for liking people and developed it into an occult science. Granny Weatherwax did not doubt that her friend already knew the names, family histories, birthdays and favourite topics of conversation of half the people here, and probably also the vital wedge that would cause them to open up. It might be talking about their children, or a potion for their bad feet, 
or one of Nanny's really filthy stories, but Nanny would be in, and after 24 hours they'd have known her all their lives, and they'd tell her things, of their own free will. Nanny got on with people. Nanny could get a statue to cry on her shoulder and say what it really thought about pigeons. It was a knack. Granny had never had the patience to acquire it. Just occasionally she wondered whether it might have been a good idea. Curtain up in an hour and a half, said Nanny. I promised Giselle I'd give her a hand. Who's Giselle? She does makeup. You don't know how to do makeup. I distempered our privy, didn't I? said Nanny. And I paint faces on eggs for the kiddies every soul cake Tuesday. Got anything else, have you? said Granny sarcastically. Open the curtains. Fill in for a ballet dancer who's been taken poorly. I did say I dealt with the drinks at the soiree, said Nanny, letting the irony slide off like water on a red-hot stove. Well, a lot of the stuff have buggered off because of the ghost. It's in the big foyer in half an hour. I expect you ought to be there being a patroniser. What's a soiree? said Granny suspiciously. It's a sort of posh party before the opera. What do I have to do? Drink sherry and make polite conversation, said Nanny. Or conversation, anyway. I saw the grub being done for it. They've even got little cubes of cheese on sticks and stuck in a grapefruit. And you don't get much posher than that. Git a hog, you ain't done any special dishes, have you? No, Esme, said Nanny Hogg meekly. Only you've got an imp of mischief in you. Been far too busy for anything like that, said Nanny. Granny nodded. Then we'd better find Grebo, she said. You sure about this, Esme? said Nanny. We might have a lot to do tonight, said Granny. Maybe we could do with an extra pair of hands. Pause. At the moment, yes. It was Walter. Agnes knew it. It wasn't knowledge in her mind, exactly. It was practically something she breathed. She felt it as a tree feels the sun. It all fitted. He could go anywhere and no one took any notice of Walter Plinge. In a way, he was invisible because he was always there. And if you were someone like Walter Plinge, wouldn't you long to be someone as debonair and dashing as the ghost? If you were someone like Agnes Knit, wouldn't you long to be someone as dark and mysterious as Perdita X Dream? The traitor thought was there before she could choke it off. She added hurriedly, But I've never killed anyone. Because that's what I'd have to believe, isn't it? If he's the ghost, then he's killed people. All the same, he does look odd, and he talks as if the words are trying to escape. A hand touched her shoulder. She spun round. It's only me, said Christine. Oh, don't you think this is a marvellous dress? What? This dress, silly. Agnes looked her up and down. Oh, yes, very nice, she said, disinterest lying on her voice like rain on a midnight pavement. Don't sound very impressed. Really, Perdita, there's no need to be jealous. I'm not jealous. I was thinking... She'd only seen the ghost for a moment, but he certainly hadn't moved like Walter. Walter walked as though his body were being dragged along by his head, but the certainty was as hard as marble now. Well, you don't seem very impressed, I must say. I'm wondering if Walter Plinge is the ghost, said Agnes, and immediately cursed herself, or at least pooted. She felt embarrassed enough about Andre's reaction. Christine's eyes widened. But he's a clown! He walks odd and he talks odd, said Agnes, but if he stood up straight... Christine laughed. Agnes felt herself getting angry, and he practically told me he was. You believed him, did you? Christine made a little tutting sound that Agnes considered quite offensive. Really? You girls believe the strangest things. What do you mean, we girls? Oh, you know, the dancers are always saying they've seen the ghost all over the place. Good grief, do you think I'm some sort of impressionable idiot? Think for a minute before answering. Well, uh, of course I don't, but... <laughs> Agnes strode off into the wings, concerned more with effect than direction. The background noise of the stage faded behind her as she stepped into the scenery store. It didn't lead anywhere except to a pair of big double doors opening into the world outside. It was full of bits of castles, balconies and romantic prison cells, stacked any old how. Christine hurried up behind her. I really didn't mean, look, not Walter. He's just a very odd, odd job man. 
He does all kinds of jobs. No one ever knows where he is. They all just assume he's around. All right, but you don't have to get so worked up. There was the faintest of sounds behind them. They turned. The ghost bowed. End of side 11. Side 12. Who's a good boy then? Nanny's got a bowl of fish eggs for a good boy, said Nanny, trying to see under the big dresser in the kitchen. Fish eggs, said Granny coldly. I borrowed them from the stuff they have done for the soiree, said Nanny. Borrowed, said Granny. That's right. Come along, Grebo. Who's a good boy then? Borrowed? You mean when the cat's finished with them, you're going to give them back? It's only a manner of speaking, Esme, said Nanny in a hurt little voice. It's not the same as stealing if you don't mean it. Come along, boy, here's some lovely fish eggs for you. Grebo pulled himself further into the shadows. There was a little sigh from Christine, and she folded up into a faint. But she managed, Agnes noticed sourly, to collapse in a way that probably didn't hurt when she hit the ground, and which showed off her dress to the best effect. It was beginning to dawn on Agnes that Christine was remarkably clever in some specialised ways. She looked back at the mask. It's all right, she said, her voice sounding hoarse even to her. I know why you're doing it. I really do. No expression could cross that ivory face, but the eyes flickered. Agnes swallowed. The Perdita part of her wanted to give in right now because that would be more exciting. But she stood her ground. You want to be something else and you're stuck with what you are, said Agnes. I know all about that. You're lucky. All you have to do is put on a mask. At least you're the right shape. But why did you have to go and kill people? Why? Mr Pounder couldn't have done you any harm. But he... he poked around in odd places, didn't he? And he found something. The ghost nodded slightly and then held out his ebony cane. He grasped both ends and pulled so that a long, thin sword slid out. I know who you are, Agnes burst out as he stepped forward. I could probably help you. It might not have been your fault. She backed away. I haven't done anything to you. You don't have to be afraid of me. She backed away further as the figure advanced. The eyes in the dark hollows of the mask glinted like tiny jewels. I'm your friend, don't you see? Please, Walter. Walter! It was far off an answering sound that seemed as loud as thunder and as impossible in the circumstances as a chocolate kettle. It was a clank of a bucket handle. What's the matter, Miss Perdita Knit? The ghost hesitated. There was the sound of footsteps, irregular footsteps. The ghost lowered the sword, opened a door in a piece of scenery painted to represent a castle wall, bowed ironically and slipped away. Walter rounded a corner. He was an unlikely knight-errant. For one thing, he had on evening dress, obviously designed for someone of a different shape. He was still wearing his beret. He also wore an apron and was carrying a mop and bucket. But no heroic lance-wielding rescuer ever galloped over a drawbridge more happily. He was practically surrounded by a golden glow. Walter? What's the matter with Miss Christine? She, uh... uh she fainted, said Agnes. Uh, probably... Yeah, probably the excitement with the opera tonight. Yes, probably the excitement uh, because of the opera tonight. Walter gave her a slightly worried look. Yes, he said, and added patiently, I know where there's a medicine box. Shall I get it? Christine groaned and fluttered her eyelashes. Uh, where am I? Perdita gritted Agnes's teeth. Where am I? That didn't sound the sort of thing someone said when they woke up from a faint. sounded more like the sort of thing they said because they'd heard it was the sort of thing people said. You fainted, she said. She looked hard at Walter. Why were you in here, Walter? Got to mop out the stage hands privy, Miss Nitt. Always having trouble. I've been working on it for months. But you're wearing evening dress. Yes, then I got to be a waiter afterwards because we're short-handed and there's no one else to be a waiter when they have drinks and sausages on poles before the opera. No one could have moved that fast. 
True, Walter and the ghost hadn't both been in the room at the same time, but she'd heard his voice. No one could have had time to duck around behind the piles of flats and turn up at the opposite side of the room in seconds, unless they were some sort of wizard. Some of the girls did say the ghost could almost seem to be in two places at once. Perhaps there were other secret places like the old staircase. Perhaps he... She stopped herself. Walter Plinge wasn't the ghost then. There was no sense in trying to find some excitable explanation to prove wrong right. She'd told Christine. Well, Christine was giving her just a slightly bemused look as Walter helped her up. And she'd told Andre, but he hadn't seemed to believe her, so probably that was all right. Which meant that the ghost was someone else. She'd been so certain. You'll enjoy it, Mother. You really will. Shame for the likes of us, Henry. I don't see why Mr. Morecambe couldn't give you tickets to see Nelly Stamp at the music hall. Now that's what I call music. Proper tunes, you can understand. Songs like She Sits Among the Cabbages and Leeks are not very cultural, Mother. Two figures wandered through the crowds heading for the opera house. This was their conversation. It's a good laugh, though, and you don't have to hire suits. Seems daft to me, having to wear a special suit just to listen to music. It enhances the experience, said young Henry, who had read this somewhere. I mean, how does the music know, said his mother. Now, Nelly, stamp. Come along, mother. It was going to be one of those evenings, he knew it. Henry Lawsey did his best. And, given the starting point, it wasn't a bad best. He was a clerk in the firm of Morecambe, Slant and Honey Place, a somewhat old-fashioned legal partnership. One reason for its less-than-modern approach was the fact that Messrs. Morecambe and Honey Place were vampires, and Mr. Slant was a zombie. The three partners were therefore technically dead, although this did not prevent them putting in a proper day's work, normally during the night, in the case of Mr. Morecambe and Mr. Honey Place. From Henry's point of view, the hours were good and the job was not onerous, but he chafed somewhat about his promotion prospects because clearly dead men's shoes were being fully occupied by dead men. He decided that the only way to succeed was to better himself by improving his mind, which he tried to do at every opportunity. It is probably a full description of Henry Lawson's mind that if you had given him a book called How to Improve Your Mind in Five Minutes, he would have read it with a stopwatch. His progress through life was hampered by his tremendous sense of his own ignorance, a disability which affects all too few people. Mr. Morecambe had given him two opera tickets as a reward for sorting out a particularly problematical tort. He'd invited his mother because she represented 100% of all the women he knew. People tended to shake Henry's hand cautiously in case it came off. He'd bought a book about the opera and read it carefully, because he'd heard that it was absolutely unheard of to go to an opera without knowing what it was about, and the chance of finding out while you were actually watching it was remote. The book's reassuring weight was in his pocket right now. All he needed to complete the evening was a less embarrassing parent. Can we get some peanuts before we go in? said his mother. Mother, they don't sell peanuts at the opera. No peanuts? What are you supposed to do if you don't like the songs? Grebo's suspicious eyes were two glows in the gloom. Hark him with a broom handle, suggested Granny. No, said Nanny, with someone like Grebo, you have to use a little bit of kindness. Granny closed her eyes and waved a hand. There was a yowl from under the kitchen's dresser and a sound of frantic scrabbling. Then his claws scoring tracks in the floor. Grebo came out backwards, fighting all the way. Mind you, a lot of cruelty does the trick as well, Nanny conceded. You've never been much of a cat person, have you, Esme? Grebo would have hissed at Granny, except that even his cat brain was just bright enough to realise this was not the best move he could make. Give him his fish eggs, Granny said. He might as well have them now as later. Grebo inspected the dish. Oh, this was all right, then. They wanted to give him food. Granny nodded at Nanny Og. They held out their hands, palm up. Grebo was halfway through the caviar when he felt it happening. He wailed, and then the voice went deeper as his chest expanded and rose physically as his back legs lengthened under him. His ears flattened against his head and then crept down his sides. 
The jacket's a 44-inch chest, said Nanny. Granny nodded. <coughs> his face flattened. His whiskers spread out. Grebo's nose developed a life of its own. <coughs> Shit! He certainly gets the hang of it quicker these days, said Nanny. You put some clothes on right now, my lad, said Granny, who had shut her eyes. Not that this made much difference, she had to admit later. Grebo, fully clothed, still managed to communicate the nakedness beneath. The insouciant moustache, the long sideburns and the tousled black hair combined with the well-developed muscles to give the impression of the more louche kind of buccaneer or a romantic poet who'd given up on the opium and tried red meat instead. He had a scar running across his face and a black patch now where it crossed the eye. When he smiled, he exuded an easy air of undistilled, excitingly dangerous lasciviousness. He could swagger while asleep. Grebo could, in fact, commit sexual harassment simply by sitting very quietly in the next room. Except as far as the witches were concerned. To Granny, a cat was a damn cat, whatever shape it was, and Nanny Og always thought of him as Mr. Fluffy. She adjusted the bow tie and stood back critically. What do you think? she said. He looks like an assassin, but he'll do, said Granny. Oh, what a nasty thing to say. Grebo waved his arms experimentally and fumbled with the ebony cane. Fingers took a bit of getting used to, but cat reflexes learned fast. Nanny waved a finger playfully under his nose. He took a half-hearted swipe at it. Now you just stay with Granny and do what she tells you like a good boy, she said. Yes, Nanny, said Grebo reluctantly. He managed to grip the stick properly. And no fighting. No, Nanny. And no leaving bits of people on the doormat. No, Nanny. We'll have no trouble like we did with those robbers last month. No, Nanny. He looked depressed. Humans had no fun. Incredible complications surrounded the most basic activities. And no turning back into a cat again until we say, Yes, Nanny. Play your cards right and there could be a kipper in this for you. Yes, Nanny. What are we going to call him? said Granny. He can't just be Grebo, which I've always said was a damn silly name for a cat. Well, he looks aristocratic, Nanny began. He looks like a beautiful brainless bully, Granny corrected her. Aristocratic, repeated Nanny. Same thing. We can't call him Grebo anyway. We'll think of something. Salzella leaned disconsolately against the marble banister of the foyer's grand staircase and stared gloomily into his drink. It had always seemed to him that one of the major flaws in the whole business of opera was the audience. They were quite unsuitable. The only ones worse than the ones who didn't know anything at all about music and whose idea of a sensible observation was, I liked that bit near the end when her voice went wobbly, were the ones who thought they did. Want a drink, do you, Mr. Salzella? There's lots, you know. Walter Plin jambled by, his black suit making him look like a very good class of scarecrow. Plinge, you just say, drink, sir, said the director of music, and please take off that ridiculous beret. My mum made it for me. I'm sure she did, but Bucket sidled up to him. Ah, I thought I told you to keep Signor Basilica away from the canapes, he hissed. I'm sorry, I couldn't find a big enough crowbar said Salzella, waving away Walter and his beret. Anyway, isn't he supposed to be communing with his muse in his dressing room? The curtain goes up in twenty minutes. He says he sings better on a full stomach. Then we are in for a treat tonight. Bucket turned and surveyed the scene. Oh, well, it's going well anyway, he said. I suppose so. The watcher here, you know, in secret, they are mingling... Ah, let me guess. Salzella looked around at the crowds. There was indeed a very short man in a suit intended for a rather larger man. This was especially the case with the opera cloak, which actually trailed on the floor behind him to give the overall impression of a superhero who had spent too much time around the kryptonite. He was wearing a deformed fur hat and trying surreptitiously to smoke a cigarette. You mean that little man with the words Watch Man in Disguise flashing on and off just above his head? Where? Oh, I didn't see that. Salzella sighed. It's Corporal Nobby Nobs, he said wearily.
the only person to require an identity card to prove his species. I've watched him mingle with three large sherries. He's not the only one, though, said Mr. Bucket. They're taking this seriously. Oh, yes, said Salzella. If we look over there, for example, we see Sergeant Detritus, who is a troll, and who is wearing what in the circumstances is actually a rather well-fitting suit. It is therefore I feel something of a pity he has neglected to remove his helmet. And these, you understand, the watch has chosen for their ability to blend. Well, they'll, uh, they'll certainly be useful if the ghost strikes again, said Bucket, hopelessly. The ghost would have to... Salzella stopped. He blinked. Oh, good grief, he whispered. What has she found? Bucket turned. That's Lady Esmeralda. Oh. Grebo strolled in alongside her with the gentle swagger that makes women thoughtful and men's knuckles go white. The buzz of conversation was momentarily hushed and then rose again to a slightly shriller buzz. I'm impressed, said Salzella. He, um, certainly doesn't look like a gentleman, said Bucket. Look at the colour of that eye. He set his face into what he hoped was a smile and bowed. Well, Lady Esmeralda, he said, how pleasant to see you again. Uh, won't you introduce us to your, um, uh, guest? This is Lord Gribeau, said Granny. Mr. Bucket, the owner, and Mr. Salzella, who seems to run the place. Ha, ha said Salzella. Gribeau snarled, revealing longer incisors than any that Bucket had seen outside a zoo, and Bucket had never seen such a greenish-yellow eye. The pupil was all wrong. Ha ha, ha he said, and, 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 and may I order you something? He'll have milk, said Granny firmly. I expect he has to keep up his strength, said Salzella. Granny spun around, her expression would have etched steel. "'Anyone for a drink?' said Nanny Og, appearing out of nowhere with a tray and adroitly stepping between them like a very small peacekeeping force. "'Got a bit of everything here?' "'Including a glass of milk, I see,' said Bucket. Salzella looked from one witch to the other. "'That's remarkably foresighted of you,' he said. "'Well, you never know,' said Nanny. Gribeau took the glass in both hands and lapped at it with his tongue. Then he looked at Salzella. What you're looking at? Never seen milk drunk before? Never quite like that, I must admit. Nanny winked at Granny Weatherwax as she turned to scurry away. Granny caught her arm. Remember, she whispered, when we go into the box, you keep an eye on Mrs. Plinge. Mrs. Plinge knows something. I ain't sure what's going to happen, but it is going to happen. Right, said Nanny. She bustled off, muttering under her breath. Oh, yes, do this, do that. Drink here, please, ma'am. Nanny looked down. Good grief, she said. What are you? The apparition in the fur hat winked at her. I'm uh, the uh, Count de Nobs, it said. And this here, it added, indicating a mobile wall, is the Count de Tritus. <laughs> Nanny glanced at the troll. Another Count? I'm sure there's unaccountably more counts here than I can count. And what can I get you, officers? She said. Officers? Oh, us, said the Count de Nobs. What makes you think we're watchmen? Well, oh, he's got a helmet on, Nanny pointed out. Also, he's got his badge pinned on his coat. I told you to put it away, Nobby hissed. He looked at Nanny and smiled uneasily. Military chic, he said. <laughs> It's just a fashion accessory. Actually, we are gentlemen of means and have nothing to do with the city watch whatsoever. Well, gentlemen, would you like some wine? Not while we're on duty, thanks, said the troll. Oh, yes, thank you very much, Count Detritus, said Nobby bitterly. Oh, yes, very undercover, that is. Why don't you just wave your truncheon around where everyone can see it? Well, if you think it'd help, put it away. The Count Detritus's eyebrows met with the effort of thought. That was irony, then, was it? To a superior officer? Can't be a superior officer, can you? Cos we ain't watchmen. Look, Commander Vimes explained it three times. 
Nanny Og tactfully moved away. It was bad enough watching them blow their cover without sucking at it as well. This was a new world, all right. She was used to a life where the men wore the bright clothes and the women wore black. It made it a lot easier to decide what to put on in the mornings. But inside the opera house, the rules of clothing were all in reverse, just like the laws of common sense. Here, the women dressed like frosted peacocks, and the men looked like penguins. So, there were coppers here. Nanny Og was basically a law-abiding person when she had no reason to break the law, and therefore had that kind of person's attitude to law enforcement officers, which was one of deep and permanent distrust. There was their approach to theft, for example. Nanny had a witch's view of theft, which was a lot more complicated than the attitude adopted by the law, and if it came to it, people who owned property were stealing. They tended to wield the huge blunt axe of the law in circumstances that required the delicate scalpel of common sense. No, thought Nanny, policemen with their great big boots were not required here on a night like this. It would be a good idea to put a thumbtack under the ponderous feet of justice. She ducked behind a gilt statue and fumbled in the recesses of her clothing while people nearby looked around in puzzlement at the erratic twanging of elastic. She was sure she had one around somewhere. She'd packed it in case of emergencies. There was the clink of a small bottle. Ah, yes. A moment later, Nanny Og emerged decorously with two small glasses on her tray and headed purposefully for the watchman. Fruit drink, officers, she said. Oh, silly me, what am I saying? I didn't mean officers. Home-made fruit drink? Detritus sniffed suspiciously, immediately clearing his sinuses. What's in it? he said. Apples, said Nanny Og promptly. Well, mainly apples. Under her hand, a couple of spilt drops finished eating their way through the metal of the tray and dropped onto the carpet where they smoked. The auditorium buzzed with the sound of opera-goers settling down and Mrs. Lawsey trying to find her shoes. You really shouldn't have taken them off, Mother. My feet are giving me chip. Did you bring your knitting? I think I must have left it in the ladies. Oh, Mother! Henry Lawsey marked his place in his book and raised his runny eyes heavenward and blinked. Right above him, a long way above him, was a glittering circle of light. His mother followed his gaze. What's that, then? I think it's a chandelier, mother. It's a pretty big one. What's holding it up? I'm sure they've got special ropes and things, mother. Looks a bit dangerous to my mind. I'm sure it's absolutely safe, mother. What do you know about chandeliers? I'm sure people wouldn't come into the opera house if there was any chance of a chandelier dropping on their heads, mother, said Henry, trying to read his book. Il Truccatore, the master of disguise. Il Truccatore, tenor, a mysterious nobleman, causes scandal in the city when he woos high-born ladies while disguised as their husbands. However, Laura, soprano, the new bride of Capriccio, baritone, refuses to give in to his blandishments. Henry put a bookmark in the book, took a smaller book from his pocket, and carefully looked up blandishments. He was moving in a world he wasn't quite sure of. Embarrassment lay waiting at every turn, and he wasn't going to get caught out over a word. Henry lived his life in permanent dread of being asked questions later. And with the help of his servant, Wingy, tenor, he adopts a subterfuge. The dictionary came out again for a moment, culminating, and again, in the scene at the famous masked ball at the Duke's palace. But Il Truccatore has not reckoned with his old adversary, the Count de... Adversary, Henry sighed, and reached for his pocket. Curtain up in five minutes. Salzella reviewed his troops. They consisted of scene builders and painters and all those other employees who could be spared for the evening. At the end of the line, about fifty percent of Walter Plinge had managed to stand to attention. Now, you all know your positions, said Salzella, and if you see anything, anything at all, you are to let me know at once. Do you understand? Mr. Salzella. Yes, Walter? We mustn't interrupt the opera, Mr. Salzella. Salzella shook his head. People will understand, I'm sure. Show must go on, Mr. Salzella. Walter, you will do what you're told. Someone raised a hand. He's got a point, though, Mr. Salzella. Salzella rolled his eyes. Just catch the ghost, he said. If we can do it without a lot of shouting, that's good. 
Of course I don't want to stop the show. He saw them relax. A deep chord rolled out over the stage. What the hell was that? Salzella strode behind the stage and was met by Andre, looking excited. What's going on? We repaired it, Mr. Salzella. Only, well, he doesn't want to give up the seat. The librarian nodded at the director of music. Salzella knew the orangutan, and among the things he knew was that if the librarian wanted to sit somewhere, then that was where he sat. But he was a first-class organist. Salzella had to admit. His lunchtime recitals in the Great Hall of Unseen University were extremely popular, especially since the university's organ had every single sound effect that bloody stupid Johnson's inverted genius had been able to contrive. No one would have believed before a pair of simian hands had worked on the project that something like Doinoff's romantic prelude in G could be rescored for whoopee cushion and squashed rabbits. There's the overtures, said Andre, and the ballroom scene. At least get him a bow tie," said Salzella. "No one can see him, Mr. Salzella, and he hasn't really got much of a neck. We do have standards, Andre. Yes, Mr. Salzella. Since you seem to have been relieved of employment this evening, then perhaps you could help us apprehend the ghost. Certainly, Mr. Salzella. Fetch him a tie then, and come with me. A little later, left to himself, the librarian opened his copy of the score and placed it carefully on the stand. He reached down under the seat and pulled out a large brown paper bag of peanuts. He wasn't entirely sure why Andre, having talked him into playing the organ this evening, had told the other man that it was because he, the librarian, wouldn't budge. In fact, he'd got some interesting cataloguing to do and had been looking forward to it. Instead, he seemed to be here for the night. Although a pound of shelled peanuts was handsome pay by any ape's standards, the human mind was a deep and abiding mystery, and the librarian was glad he didn't have one any more. He inspected the bow tie, as Andre had foreseen. It presented certain problems to someone who'd been behind the door when the necks were handed out. Granny Weatherwax stopped in front of box eight and looked around. Mrs. Plinge wasn't visible. She unlocked the door with what was probably the most expensive key in the world. And you behave yourself, she said. Yes, Granny moaned Grebo. No going to the lavatory in the corners. No, Granny. Granny glared at her escort. Even in a bow tie, even with his fine moustaches waxed, he was still a cat. You just couldn't trust them to do anything except turn up for meals. The inside of the box was rich red plush, picked out with gilt decoration. It was like a soft little private room. There were a couple of fat pillars on either side, supporting part of the weight of the balcony above. She looked over the edge and noted the drop to the stalls below. Of course, someone could probably climb in from one of the adjacent boxes, but that had been full view of the audience and would be bound to cause some comment. She peeked under the seats. She stood on a chair and felt around the ceiling, which had gilt stars on it. She inspected the carpet minutely. She smiled at what she saw. She had been prepared to bet that she knew how the ghost got in, and now she was certain. Grebo spat on his hand and tried ineffectually to groom his hair. "You sit quiet and eat your fish eggs," said Granny. "Yes, Granny, and watch the opera. It's good for you." "Yes, Granny." "Evening, Mrs. Plinge," said Nanny cheerfully. "Ain't this exciting? The buzz of the audience, the air of expectation." The blokes in the orchestra finding somewhere to hide the bottles and trying to remember how to play, all the exhilaration and drama of the operatic experience waiting to unfold. Oh, hello, Mrs. Og," said Mrs. Plinge. She was polishing glasses in her tiny bar. Certainly very packed," said Nanny. She looked sidelong at the old woman. It was central to Nanny Og's soul that she never considered herself an old woman, while of course availing herself of every advantage that other people's perceptions of her as such would bring. Every seat sold, I heard. This didn't achieve the expected reaction. Shall I give you a hand cleaning out box eight? She went on. Oh, I cleaned it out last week," said Mrs. Plinge. She held up a glass to the light. Yes, but I hear her ladyship is very particular," said Nanny. "Very picky about things." "What ladyship? Mister Bucket has sold box eight. See," said Nanny. She heard a faint tinkle of glass. Ah, Missus Plinge appeared at the doorway of her nook. 
But he can't do that. It's his opera house, said Nanny, watching Mrs. Plinge carefully. I suppose he thinks he can. It's the ghost's box. Opera goers were appearing along the corridor. I shouldn't think he'd mind just for one night, said Nanny Og. The show must go on, eh? Are you all right, Mrs. Plinge? I think I'd better just go and... She began stepping forward. No, you have a good sit down and a rest, said Nanny, pressing her back with gentle but irresistible force. But I should go and... And what, Mrs. Plinge, said Nanny. The old woman went pale. Granny Weatherwax could be nasty, but the nastiness was always in the window. You were aware that it might turn up on the menu. Sharpness from Nanny Og, though, was like being bitten by a friendly dog. It was all the worse for being unexpected. I dare say you wanted to go and have a word with somebody. Did you, Mrs. Plinge? said Nanny softly. Someone who might be a little shocked to find his box full, perhaps. I reckon I could put a name to that someone, Mrs. Plinge. Now, if the old woman's hand came up holding a bottle of champagne and then came down hard in an effort to launch the SS Githa Og onto the seas of unconsciousness, the bottle bounced. Then Mrs. Plinge leapt past and scuttled away, her polished little black boots twinkling. Nanny Og caught the door frame and swayed a little while blue and purple fireworks went off behind her eyes. But there was dwarf in the Og ancestry and that meant a skull you could go mining with. She stared muzzily at the bottle. Year of the insulted goat, she mumbled. That's a good year. Then consciousness gained the upper hand. She grinned as she galloped after the retreating figure. In Mrs. Plinge's place, she'd have done exactly the same thing, except a good deal harder. End of Side 12「Agnes waited with the others for the curtain to go up. She was one of the crowd of fifty or so townspeople who would hear Enrico Basilica sing of his success as a master of disguise, it being a vital part of the entire process that while the chorus would listen to expositions of the plot and even sing along, they would suffer an instant lapse of memory afterwards so that later unmaskings would come as a surprise.' For some reason, without any word being spoken, as many people as possible seemed to have acquired very broad, brimmed hats. Those who hadn't were taking every opportunity to glance upwards. Beyond the curtain, Herr Trubelmacher launched the overture. Enrico, who had been chewing a chicken leg, carefully put the bone on a plate and nodded. The waiting stagehand dashed off. The opera had begun. Mrs. Plinge reached the bottom of the grand staircase and hung on to the banister, panting. The opera had started. There was no one around and no sounds of pursuit either. She straightened up and tried to get her breath back. Cooey, Mrs. Plinge! Nanny Og, waving the champagne bottle like a club, was already travelling at speed when she hit the first turn in the banister, but she leaned like a professional and kept her balance as she went into the straight and then tilted again for the next curve, which left only the big gilt statue at the bottom. It is the fate of all banisters worth sliding down that there is something nasty waiting at the far end. But Nanny Og's response was superb. She swung her leg over as she hurled downwards and pushed herself off, her nailed boots leaving grooves in the marble as she spun to a halt in front of the old woman. Mrs. Plinge was lifted off her feet and carried into the shadows behind another statue. You don't want to try and outrun me, Mrs. Plinge, Nanny whispered as she clamped her hand firmly over Mrs. Plinge's mouth. You just want to wait here quietly with me. And don't go thinking I'm nice. I'm only nice compared to Esme. But uh, so is practically everyone. Mm. With one hand tightly around Mrs. Plinge's arm and the other over her mouth, Nanny peered round the statue. She could hear the singing far off. Nothing else happened. After a while, she started to fret. Perhaps he'd taken fright. Perhaps Mrs. Plinge had left him some sort of signal. Perhaps he decided that the world was currently too dangerous for ghosts, although Nanny doubted he could ever decide that. At this rate, the first act would be over before... The door opened somewhere. A lanky figure in a black suit and a ridiculous beret crossed the foyer and went up the stairs. At the top, they saw it turn in the direction of the boxes and disappear. 
You see, said Nanny, trying to get the stiffness out of her limbs, the thing about Esme is, she's stupid. Hmm? So she thinks that the most obvious way, you see, for the ghost to get in and out of the box is through the door. If you can't find a secret panel, she reckons it's because it ain't there. A secret panel that ain't there is the best kind there is. The reason being no bugger can find it. That's where you people all think too operatic, see? You're all cooped up in this place, listening to daft plots what don't make sense, and I reckon it does something to your minds. People can't find a trapdoor, so they say, Oh, dearie me, what a hidden trapdoor it must be. Whereas a normal person, e.g. me and Esme, we'd say, Maybe there ain't one then. And the best way for the ghost to get around the place without being seen is for him to be seen and not noticed. Especially if he's got keys. People don't notice Walter. They look the other way. She gently released her grip. Now, I don't blame you, Mrs. Plinge, cos I'd do the same for one of mine. But you'd have done better to trust Esme right at the start. She'll help you if she can. Nanny let Mrs. Plinge go, but kept a grip on the champagne bottle, just in case. What if she can't? said Mrs. Plinge bitterly. You think Walter did those murders? He's a good boy. I'm sure that's the same as a no, isn't it? They'll put him in prison. If he done them murders, Esme won't let that happen, said Nanny. Something sank into Mrs. Plinge's not very alert mind. What do you mean she won't let that happen? she said. I mean, said Nanny, that if you throw yourself on Esme's mercy, you'd better be damn sure you deserve to bounce. Oh, Mrs. Ogg. Now don't you worry about anything, said Nanny, perhaps a little late under the circumstances. It occurred to her that the immediate future might be a little bit easier on everyone if Mrs. Plinge got some well-earned rest. She fumbled in her clothing and produced a bottle half full of some cloudy orange liquid. I'll just give you a sip of a little something to calm your nerves. What is it? It's a sort of tonic, said Nanny. She flicked the cork out with her thumb. On the ceiling above her, the paint crinkled. It's made from apples. Well, mainly apples. Walter Plinge stopped outside box eight and looked around. Then he removed his beret and pulled out the mask. The beret went into his pocket. He straightened up, and it looked very much as though Walter Plinge with the mask on was several inches taller. He took a key from his pocket and unlocked the door, and the figure that stepped into the box did not move like Walter Plinge. It moved as though every nerve and muscle were under full and athletic control. The sounds of the opera filled the box. The walls had been lined with red velvet and were hung with curtains. The chairs were high and well padded. The ghost slipped into one of them and settled down. A figure leaned forward out of the other chair and said, You can't have my fish eggs. The ghost leapt up. The door clicked behind him. Granny stepped out from the curtains. Well, well, we meet again, she said. He backed away to the edge of the box. I shouldn't think you could jump, said Granny. It's a long way down. She focused her best stare on the white mask. And now, Mr. Ghost. He sprang back onto the edge of the box, saluted Granny flamboyantly, and leapt upwards. Granny blinked. Up until now, the stare had always worked. Too damn dark, she muttered. Grebo! The bowl of caviar flew out of his nervous fingers and caused a fortean experience somewhere in the stalls. Yes, Granny, catch him, and there could be a kipper in it for you. Grebo snarled happily. This was more like it. Opera had begun to pall for him the moment he realised that no one was going to pour a bucket of cold water over the singers. He understood chasing things. Besides, he liked to play with his friends. Agnes saw the movement out of the corner of her eye. A figure had jumped out of one of the boxes and was climbing up to the balcony. Then another figure clambered after it, scrambling over the gilt cherubs. Singers faltered in mid-note. There was no mistaking the leading figure. It was the ghost. The librarian was aware that the orchestra had stopped playing. Somewhere on the other side of the backcloth, the singers had stopped too. There was a buzz of excited conversation and one or two cries. The hairs all over his body began to prickle. Senses designed to protect his species in the depths of the rainforest had adjusted nicely to the conditions of a big city, which was merely drier and had more carnivores. 
He picked up the discarded bow tie and with great deliberation tied it around his forehead so that he looked like a really formal kamikaze warrior. Then he threw away the opera score and stared blankly into space for a moment. He knew instinctively that some situations required musical accompaniment. This organ lacked what he considered the most basic of facilities, such as the thunder pedal, a 128-foot earthquake pipe, and a complete keyboard of animal noises, but he was certain there was something exciting that could be done in the bass register. He stretched out his arms and cracked his knuckles. This took some time, and then he began to play. The ghost danced along the edge of the balcony, scattering hats and opera glasses. The audience watched in astonishment, and then began to clap. They couldn't quite see how it fitted into the plot of the opera, but this was an opera, after all. He reached the centre of the balcony, trotted a little way up the aisle, and then turned and ran down again at speed. He reached the edge, jumped, jumped again, soared out into the auditorium, and landed on the chandelier, which jingled and began to sway gently. The audience stood up and applauded as he climbed through the jangling tiers towards the central cable. Then another shape clambered over the edge of the balcony and loped along in pursuit. This was a stockier figure than the first man, one-eyed, broad in the shoulders and tapering at the waist. He looked evil in an interesting kind of way, like a pirate who really understood the words Jolly Roger. He didn't even take a run, but when he reached the closest part to the chandelier, simply launched himself into space. It was clear that he wasn't going to make it. And then it wasn't clear how he did. Those watching through opera glasses swore later that the man thrust out an arm which merely seemed to graze the chandelier, and yet was then somehow able to swivel his entire body in mid-air. A couple of people swore even harder that just as the man reached out, his fingernails appeared to grow by several inches. The huge glass mountain swung ponderously on its rope, and as it reached the end of the swing, Grebo swung out further like a trapeze artist. There was an appreciative ooh from the audience. He twisted again. The chandelier hesitated for a moment at the extremity of its arc, and then swept back again. As it jangled and creaked over the stalls, the hanging figure swung upwards, let go, and did a backward somersault that dropped him in the middle of the crystals. Candles and prisms were scattered over the seats below. And then, with the audience clapping and cheering, he scrambled up the rope after the fleeing ghost. Henry Lawsey tried to move his arm, but a fallen crystal had stapled the sleeve of his coat to his armrest. It was a quandary. He was pretty sure this wasn't supposed to happen, but he wasn't certain. Around him he could hear people hissing questions. Was that part of the plot? I, I, I'm sure it must have been. Oh, yes, yes, it certainly was, said someone further down the row, authoritatively. Yes, yes, the famous chase scene. Mm, indeed, oh yes, they did it in Quirm, you know. Oh yes, of course, yes, yes, I'm sure I heard about it. I thought he was bloody good, said Mrs. Lawsey. Mother, about time something interesting happened. You should have told me I'd have put my glasses on. Nanny Og pounded up the back stairs towards the fly loft. Something's gone wrong, she muttered under her breath as she took the stairs two at a time. She reckons she's only got to stare at them and their toffee in her hands. And then who has to sort it out afterwards, eh? Go on, guess. The ancient wooden door at the top of the stairs gave way to Nanny Og's boot, with Nanny Og's momentum behind it, and cracked open to a big shadowy space. It was full of running figures, legs flickered in the light of lanterns, people were shouting. A figure ran straight towards her. Nanny sprang into a crouch, both thumbs on the cork of the badly shaken champagne bottle she held cradled under one arm. This is a magnum, she said, and I'm not afraid to drink it. The figure stopped. Oh, it's you, Mrs. Ogg. Nanny's infallible memory for personal details threw up a card. Peter, isn't it? she said, relaxing. The one with the bad feet? That's right, Mrs. Ogg. The powder I give you is working, is it? They're a lot better now, Mrs. Ogg. So what's been happening? Mr. Salzella caught the ghost. Really? Now that Nanny's eyes had managed to discern some order in the chaos, she could see a cluster of people in the middle of the floor around the chandelier. Salzella was sitting on the planking. His collar was torn, and a sleeve had been ripped off his jacket, but he had a triumphant look in his eyes. He waved something in the air. It was white. It looked like a piece of skull. It was Plinge, he said. I tell you, it was Walter Plinge. Why are you all standing around? Get after him. Walter, said one of the men doubtfully. Yes, Walter. 
Another man hurried up, waving his lantern. I saw the ghost heading up to the roof, and there was some big one-eyed bastard going after him like a scalded cat. That's wrong, thought Nanny. Something wrong here. To the roof, shouted Salzella. Hadn't we better get the flaming torches first? Flaming torches are not compulsory. Pitchforks and scythes? That's only for vampires. How about just one torch? Get up there now, understand? The curtains closed. There was a smattering of applause which was barely audible above the chatter from the audience. The chorus turned to one another. Was that supposed to happen? Dust rained down. Stage hands were scampering across the gantries far above. Shouts echoed among the ropes and dusty backdrops. A stage hand ran across the stage holding a flaming torch. Here, what's going on? said a tenor. They've got the ghost. He's heading for the roof. It's Walter Plange. What? Walter? Our Walter Plinge? Yes. The stage hand ran on in a trail of sparks, leaving the yeast of rumour to ferment in the ready dough that was the chorus. Walter? Surely not. Well, he is a bit odd, isn't he? But only this morning he said to me, It's a nice day, Mr. Sidney, just like that, normal as anything. Well, normal for Walter. As a matter of fact, it's always worried me, the way his eyes move as though they don't talk to each other. And he's always around the place. Yes, but he's the odd job man. No argument about that. It's not Walter, said Agnes. They looked at her. That's who we said they're chasing, dear. I don't know who they're chasing, but Walter's not the ghost. Fancy anyone thinking Walter's the ghost, said Agnes hotly. He wouldn't hurt a fly. Anyway, I've seen. He's always struck me as a bit slimy, though. And they say he goes down into the cellars a lot. What for, I ask myself? Let's face it, fair's fair. He's crazy. He doesn't act crazy, said Agnes. Well, he always looks as though he's about to. You must admit it. I'm going to see what's happening. Anyone coming? Agnes gave up. It was a horrible thing to learn, but there are times when evidence gets trampled and the hunt is on. A hatch flew open. The ghost clambered out, looked down, and slammed the hatch shut. There was a yowl from below. Then he danced across the leads until he reached the gargoyle-encrusted parapet, black and silver in the moonlight. The wind caught at his cloak as he ran along the very edge of the roof and dropped down again near another door. And a gargoyle was suddenly no longer a gargoyle, but a figure that reached down suddenly and twitched off his mask. It was like cutting strings. "'Good evening, Walter,' said Granny, as he sagged to his knees. Hello, Mrs. Weatherwax. Mistress, Granny corrected him, now stand up. There was a growl further along the roof, and then a thump. Bits of trapdoor rose for a moment against the moonlight. It's nice up here, ain't it? said Granny. There's fresh air and stars. I thought up or down, but there's only rats down below. In another swift movement, she grabbed Walter's chin and tilted it, just as Grebo pulled himself onto the roof with prolonged murder in his heart. How does your mind work, Walter Plinge? If your house was on fire, what's the first thing you'd try to take out? Grebo stalked along the rooftop, growling. He liked rooftops in general, and some of his fondest memories involved them, but a trapdoor had just been slammed on his head, and he was looking for anything he could disembowel. Then he recognised the shape of Walter Plinge as someone who had given him food, and standing right next to him, the much more unwelcome shape of Granny Weatherwax, who had once caught him digging in her garden and kicked him in the cucumbers. Walter said something. Grebo didn't take much notice of it. Granny Weatherwax said, Well done. A good answer. Grebo. Grebo nudged Walter heavily in the back. Want milk right now. Brrr, brrr. Granny thrust the mask at the cat. In the distance, people were running upstairs and shouting. You put this on, and you stay down real low, Walter Plinge. One man in a mask is pretty much like another after all, and when they chase you, Grebo, give them a run for their money. Do it right. There could be... Ah, oh, I know, said Grebo despondently, taking the mask. It was turning out to be a long and busy evening for a kipper. Someone poked their head out of the stricken trap door. The light glinted off Grebo's mask, and it had to be said, even by Granny, that he made a good ghost. For one thing, his morphogenic field was trying to reassert itself. His claws could no longer even remotely be thought of as fingernails. He spat at the pursuit as they poured up the steps, arched his back dramatically on the very edge of the roof, and stepped off. 
One story down, he thrust out an arm, caught a window sill, and landed on the head of a gargoyle, which said, Oh, thank you very much, in a reproachful voice. The pursuers looked down at him. Some of them had managed to get hold of flaming torches, because sometimes convention is too strong to be lightly denied. Grebo snarled defiance and dropped again, springing from sill to drainpipe to balcony, and pausing every now and again for another dramatic pose and another snarl at the pursuers. We'd better get after him, Corporal de Nobs, said one of them, who was staggering along behind. We'd better get after him by carefully going back down the stairs, you mean? Cause something I drank don't want to stay drunk. <laughs> Much more running and I'll be dropping a custard, I'm telling you. The other members of the posse also seemed to be reaching the conclusion that there was no extended future in chasing a man down the sheer wall of a building. As one mob, they turned and, shouting and waving their torches in the air, headed back to the stairs. The parting crowd revealed Nanny Og holding a pitchfork in one hand and a torch in the other and thrusting them both in the air while muttering, Rhubarb, rhubarb! Granny walked over and tapped her on the shoulder. They've gone, Githa. Rhubarb. Oh, oh, hello, Esme said Nanny, lowering the implements of righteous retribution. I was just tagging along to see it didn't get out of hand. Was that Grebo I saw just then? Yes. Oh, bless him, said Nanny. He looked a bit bothered, though. I hope he doesn't happen to anybody. Where's your broomstick, said Granny. It's in the cleaner's cupboard backstage. Then I'll borrow it and keep an eye on things, said Granny. Hey, he's my cat. I ought to be looking after him, Nanny began. Granny stepped aside, revealing a huddled shape sitting hugging its knees. You look after Walter Plinge, she said. It's something you'd be better at than me. Hello, Mrs. Og, said Walter mournfully. Nanny looked at him for a moment. So was he the... Uh... Yes. You mean he really did do the murder? What did you think, said Granny? Well, if it comes to it, I think he didn't, said Nanny. Can I have a word in your ear, Esme? I don't reckon I should say this in front of young Walter. The witches bent their heads together. There was a brief, whispered conversation. Everything is simple when you know the answer, said Granny. I'll be back soon. She hurried off. Nanny heard her shoes clattering on the stairs. Nanny looked down at Walter again and held out her hand. Up you get, Walter. Yes, Mrs. Og. I expect we'd better find somewhere for you to lie low, eh? I know a hidden place, Mrs. Og. You do, do you? Walter lurched across the roof towards another trap door and pointed to it proudly. That? said Nanny. That doesn't look very hidden to me, Walter. Walter gave it a puzzled look and then grinned in the way a scientist might after he'd solved a particularly difficult equation. It's hidden where everyone can see it, Mrs. Og. Nanny gave him a sharp look, but there was nothing but a slightly glazed innocence in Walter's eyes. He lifted up the trapdoor and pointed politely downwards. You go down the ladder first, so I will not see your drawers. Very kind of you, said Nanny. It was the first time anyone had ever said anything like that to her. The man waited patiently until she had reached the bottom of the ladder, and then climbed laboriously down after her. This is just an old staircase, isn't it? said Nanny, prodding at the darkness with her torch. Yes. It goes all the way down, except at the bottom where it goes all the way up. Anyone else know about it? The ghost, Mrs. Og, said Walter, climbing down. Oh, yes, said Nanny slowly. And where's the ghost now, Walter? He ran away. She held up the torch. There was still nothing to be read in Walter's expression. What does the ghost do here, Walter? He watches over the opera. That's very kind of him, I'm sure. Nanny started downwards, and as the shadows danced around her, she heard Walter say, You know she asked me a very silly question, Mrs. Zog. It was a silly question. Any fool knows the answer. Oh, yes, said Nanny, peering at the walls. About houses on fire, I expect. Yes. What would I take out of her house if it was on fire? I expect you were a good boy and said you'd take your mum, said Nanny. No, my mum would take herself. Nanny ran her hands over the nearest wall. Doors had been nailed shut when the staircase had been abandoned. 
Someone walking up and down here with a keen pair of ears could hear a lot of things. What would you take out then, Walter? she said. The fire! Nanny stared, unseeing at the wall, and then her face slowly broke into a grin. You're daft, Walter Plinge, she said. Daft as a broom, Mrs. Ogg, said Walter cheerfully. But you ain't insane, she thought. You're daft, but you're sane. That's what Esme would say. And there's worse of things. Grebo pounded along Broadway. He was suddenly not feeling very well. Muscles were twitching in odd ways. A tingling at the base of his spine indicated that his tail wanted to grow, and his ears definitely wanted to creep up the sides of his head, which is always embarrassing when it happens in company. In this case, the company was about a hundred yards behind, and apparently intent on moving his ears quite a long way from their current position, embarrassment or not. It was gaining, too. Grebo normally had a famous turn of speed, but not when his knees were trying to reverse direction every few seconds. His normal plan, when pursued, was to jump onto the water butt behind Nanny Ogg's cottage and rake the pursuer across the nose with his claws when it came around the corner. Since this would now involve a 500-mile dash, an alternative had to be sought. There was a coach waiting outside one of the houses. He lurched over to it, pulled himself up, grabbed the reins and briefly turned his attention to the driver. Get off! Grebo's teeth shone in the moonlight. The coachman, with great presence of mind and urgent absence of body, somersaulted backwards into the night. The horses reared and tried to break into a gallop from a standing start. Animals are less capable of being fooled than are humans. They knew that what they had behind them was a very large cat, and the fact that it was man-shaped didn't make them any happier. The coach lumbered off. Grebo looked over his twitching shoulder at the torch-lit crowd and waved a paw derisively. The effect pleased him so much that he clambered onto the roof of the swaying coach and continued to jeer. It is a cat-like attribute to spit defiance at the enemy from a place of safety. In the circumstances, it would have been better if cat-like attributes had included the ability to steer. A wheel hit the parapet of the brass bridge and scraped along it, the iron rim kicking up sparks. The shock knocked Grebo from his perch in mid-gesture. He landed on his feet in the middle of the road, while the terrified horses continued on with the coach, rocking dangerously from side to side. The pursuers stopped. <gasps> What's he doing now? He's just standing there. There's only one of him, and there's lots of us, right? We could easily overpower him. Good idea. On the count of three, we'll all rush him, right? One, two, three. Pause. You didn't run? Well, nor did you. Yes, but I was the one saying one, two, three. Remember what he did to Mr. Pounder? Yes, well, I never liked the man all that much. Grebo snarled. Ticklish things were happening to his body. He threw his head back and roared. Look, at worst he'd only be able to get one or two of us. Oh, that's good, is it? Here, yeah. why is he twisting round like that? Maybe he hurt himself falling off the coach. Let's get him! The mob closed in. Grebo, struggling against a morphogenic field swinging wildly between species, punched the first man in the face with a hand and clawed the shirt off another man with something more like a giant paw. Whoa, sure! Twenty hands grabbed him. And then, in the melee and the darkness, twenty hands were holding just cloth and emptiness. Vengeful boots connected with nothing more than air. Clubs that had been swung at a snarling face whirled through empty space and returned to hit their owner on the ear. <laughs> Quite unnoticed in the scrum, a flat-eared bullet of grey fur shot out from between the scuffling legs. The kicking and punching stopped only when it became apparent that all the mob was attacking was itself. And since the IQ of a mob is the IQ of its most stupid member divided by the number of mobsters, it was never very clear to anyone what had happened. Obviously, they'd closed in on the ghost, and he certainly couldn't have escaped. All that was left was a mask and some torn clothing. So, the mob reasoned, he must have ended up in the river, and good riddance too. Happy in the knowledge of a job well done, they adjourned to the nearest pub. This left Sergeant Count de Tritus and Corporal the Count de Nobby Nobs, who lurched to the middle of the bridge and regarded the few scraps of cloth. Commander Vimes isn't... Isn't going to like this, said Detritus. You know he likes prisoners to be alive. Yeah, but this one would have been hung anyway, said Nobby, who was trying to stand upright. 
This way was just a bit more <laughs> democratic. A great saving in terms of rope, not to mention wear and tear on locks and keys. Detritus scratched his head. Shouldn't there be some blood? He ventured. Nobby gave him a sour look. He couldn't have got away, he said, so don't go asking questions like that. Only, if humans has hit hard enough, there are leaks all over the police, said Detritus. Nobby sighed. That was the calibre of people you got in the watch these days. They had to make a mystery of things. In days gone by, when it had been just the old gang and an unofficial policy of lazy fare, they'd have said a heartfelt, well done lads, to the vigilantes, and turned in early. But now old Vimes had been promoted to commander, he seemed to be enrolling people who asked questions all the time. It was even affecting Detritus, considered by other trolls to be as dim as a dead glowworm. Detritus reached down and picked up an eye patch. What do you think of that then? said Nobby scornfully. You think he turned into a bat and flew away? Eh? I do not think that because it is inconsistent with modern policing, said Detritus. Well, I think, said Nobby, that when you have ruled out the impossible, what is left? However improbable, ain't worth hanging around on a cold night wondering about when you could be getting on the outside of a big drink. Come on, I want to try a leg of the elephant that bit me. Was that irony? That was metaphor. Detritus, uneasy in what was technically his mind, prodded at the torn pieces of clothing. Something brushed against his leg. It was a cat. It had tattered ears, one good eye, and a face like a fist with fur on it. Hello, little cat, said Detritus. The cat stretched and grinned. Get lost, copper. Detritus blinked. There are no such things as troll cats, and Detritus had never seen a cat before he'd arrived in Ark Morpork and discovered that they were very, very hard to eat. And he'd never heard of them talking. On the other hand, he was very much aware of his reputation as the most stupid person in the city, and he wasn't going to draw attention to a talking cat if it were going to turn out that everybody except him knew that they talked all the time. In the gutter, a few feet away, there was something white. He picked it up carefully. It looked like the mask the ghost had worn. This was probably a clue. He waved it urgently. Hey, Norby! Thank you. Something dipped through the darkness, snatched the mask from the troll's hand, and soared into the night. Corporal Nobbs turned around. Yes, he said. Er, uh, how big are birds, normally? Oh, blimey, I don't know. Some are small, some are big, who cares? Detritus sucked his finger. Oh, no reason, he said. I am far too smart to be taken in by perfectly normal things. Something squelched underfoot. It's pretty damp down here, Walter said Nanny, and the air was stale and heavy and seemed to be squeezing the light from the torch. There was a dark edge to the flame. Not far now, Mrs. Og. Keys jingled in the darkness and some hinges creaked. I found this, Mrs. Og. It's the ghost's secret cave. Secret cave, eh? You've got to shut your eyes, you've got to shut your eyes, said Walter urgently. Nanny did so, but to her shame, kept a grip on the torch just in case. She said, and is the ghost in there, Walter? No. There was the rattle of a matchbox and some scuffling, and then, you can open them now, Mrs. Og. Nanny did so. Colour and light blurred and then swam into focus, first in her eyes and then eventually in her brain. Oh, my, she murmured. Oh, my, my. There were candles, the big flat ones used to illuminate the stage, floating in shallow bowls. The light they gave was soft and it rippled over the room like the soul of water. It glinted off the beak of a huge swan. It glittered in the eye of a vast sagging dragon. Nanny Og turned slowly. Her experience of opera had not been a lengthy one, but witches pick things up quickly. And there was the winged helmet worn by Hildebrunn in the ring of the Nibelungingung. And here was the striped pole from the barber of Pseudopolis. And there was the pantomime horse with the humorous trapdoor from the enchanted piccolo. And here, here, was opera, all piled in a heap. 
Once the eye had taken it all in, it had time to notice the peeling paint and rotting plaster and the general air of gentle mouldering. The decrepit props and threadbare costumes had been dumped in here because people didn't want them anywhere else. But someone did want them here. After the eye had seen the ruin, then there was time for it to see the little patches of recent repair, the careful areas of fresh paint. End of side 13. Side 14. There was something like a desk in the tiny area of floor not occupied by the props. And then Nanny realised that it had a keyboard and a stool. And there were neat piles of paper on top of it. Walter was watching her with a big, proud grin. Nanny ambled over to the thing. It's a harmonium, ain't it? A tiny organ. That's right, Mrs. Ogg. Nanny picked up one of the sheaves of paper. Her lips moved as she read the meticulous copperplate writing. An opera about cats, she said. Never heard of an opera about cats. She thought for a moment and then added to herself, But why not? It's a damn good idea. The lives of cats are just like operas when you come to think about it. She leafed through the other piles. Guys and Trolls, Hubwood's side story, Miserable Les, who's he? Seven dwarfs for seven other dwarfs? What are all these, Walter? She sat down on the stool and pressed a few of the cracked yellow keys, which moved with an audible creak. There were a couple of large pedals under the harmonium. You pedalled these, and that worked the bellows, and these spongy keys produced something which was to organ music what poot was to cursing. So this was where Walter, where the ghost sat, thought Nanny, down under the stage, among the discarded wreckage of old performances, down under the huge windowless room where night after night music and songs and rampant emotion echoed back and forth and never escaped or entirely died away. The ghost worked down here with a mind as open as a well and it filled up with opera. Opera went in at the ears and something else came out of the mind. Nanny pumped the pedals a few times. Air hissed from inefficient seams. She tried a few notes. They were reedy, but, she considered, sometimes the old lie was true, and size really did not matter. It really was what you did with it that counted. Walter watched her expectantly. She took down another wad of paper and peered at the first page, but Walter leaned over and snatched at the script. That one's not finished, Mrs. Zog. The opera house was still in uproar. Half the audience had gone outside and the other half was hanging around in case further interesting events were going to transpire. The orchestra was in a huddle in the pit, preparing its request for a special being upset by a ghost allowance. The curtains were closed. Some of the chorus had stayed on stage. Others had hurried off to take part in the chase. The air had the excited electric feel it gets when normal civilised life is temporarily short-circuited. Agnes bounced frantically from rumour to rumour. The ghost had been caught, and it was Walter Plinge. The ghost had been caught by Walter Plinge. The ghost had been caught by someone else. The ghost had escaped. The ghost was dead. There were arguments breaking out everywhere. I still can't believe it was Walter. I mean, good grief, Walter! What about the show? We can't just stop. You never stop the show, not even if someone dies. Oh, we have stopped when people died. Yes, but only as long as it took to get the body off stage. Agnes stepped back into the wings and trod on something. Sorry, she said automatically. It was only my foot, said Granny Weatherwax. So, how is life in the big city, Agnes Knit? Agnes turned. Oh, hello, Granny, she mumbled. And I'm not Agnes here, thank you, she added, a shade more defiantly. It's a good job, is it, being someone else's voice? I'm doing what I want to do, said Agnes. She drew herself up to her full width. And you can't stop me. But you ain't part of it, are you? said Granny conversationally. You try, but you always find yourself watching yourself watching people, eh? Never quite believing anything. Thinking the wrong thoughts. Shut up. Eh <laughs> heh. Thought so. I have no intention of becoming a witch, thank you very much. Now, don't go getting upset just because you know it's going to happen. A witch you're going to be, because a witch you are. And if you turn your back on him now, then I don't know what's going to happen to Walter Plinge. He's not dead. No? 
Agnes hesitated. I knew he was the ghost, she began, but then I saw he couldn't be. Ah, said Granny. Believed the evidence of your own eyes, did you? <laughs> In a place like this? One of the stagehands just told me they chased him up onto the roof and then down into the street and beat him to death. Ah oh, well, said Granny, you'll never get anywhere if you believe what you hear. What do you know? What do you mean, what do I know? Don't try cleverness on me, miss. Agnes looked at Granny's expression and knew when to fold. I know he's a ghost, she said. Right, but I can see that he isn't. Yes, and I know, well, I'm pretty sure, he doesn't mean any harm. Good, well done. Walter might not know his right from his left, but he does know his right from his wrong. Granny rubbed her hands together. Well, we're already home and looking for a clean towel, eh? What? You haven't solved anything. Of course we have. We know that it wasn't Walter what done the murders, so now we just have to find out who it was. Easy. Where's Walter now? Nanny's got him somewhere. She's all by herself. I told you she's got Walter. I meant, well, he's a bit strange. Only where it shows. Agnes sighed and started to say that it wasn't her problem and realised it was useless even to try. The knowledge sat like a smug intruder in her mind. Whatever it was, it was her problem. All right, she said. I'll help you if I can because I'm here, but afterwards that's it. Afterwards you'll leave me alone. Promise? Certainly. Well, all right then. Agnes stopped. Oh, no, she said. That was too easy. I don't trust you. Don't trust me, said Granny. You're saying you don't trust me? Yes, I don't. You'll find a way to wriggle around it. I never wriggle, said Granny. It's Nanny Og who thinks we ought to have a third witch. I reckon life's difficult enough without some girl cluttering up the place just because she thinks she looks good in a pointy hat. There was a pause. Then Agnes said, I'm not falling for that one either. It's where you say I'm too stupid to be a witch, and I say, oh no, I'm not, and you end up winning again. I'd rather be someone else's voice than some old witch with no friends and having everyone frightened of me and being nothing more than just a bit cleverer than other people and not doing any real magic at all. Granny put her head on one side. Seems to me you're so sharp you might cut yourself, she said. All right, when it's all over I'll let you go your own way. I won't stop you. Now, show me the way to Mr Bucket's office. Nanny smiled her jolly wrinkled old apple smile. Now you just hand it over, Walter, she said. No harm in letting me see it, is there? Not old Nanny. Can't see it till it's finished. Well now, said Nanny, hating herself for dropping the atom bomb, I'm sure your mum wouldn't want you to hear that you've been a bad boy, would she? Expressions floated over Walter's waxen features as he struggled with several ideas at once. Finally, without a word, he thrust the bundle at her, his arms trembling with tension. There's a good boy, said Nanny. She glanced at the first few pages and then moved them nearer to the light. Hmm. She treedled for harmonium for a while and played a few notes with her left hand. They represented most of the musical notes she knew how to read. It was a very simple little theme, such as might be picked out on the keyboard with one finger. Hey. Her lips moved as she read the narrative. Well now, Walter, she said, isn't this a sort of opera about a ghost who lives in an opera house? She turned a page. Very smart and debonair he is. Oh, he's got a secret cave, I see. She played another short riff. Catchy music, too. She read on, occasionally saying things like, Well, well, and Lorks. Every now and again, she'd give Walter an appraising look. I wonder why the ghost wrote this, Walter, she said after a while. Quiet sort of chap, ain't he? Put it all into his music. Walter stared at his feet. There's going to be a lot of trouble, Mrs. Ogg. Oh, me and Granny will sort it all out, said Nanny. It's wrong to tell lies, said Walter. Probably, said Nanny, who'd never let it worry her up to now. It wouldn't be right for our mum to lose her job, Mrs. Ogg. It wouldn't be right, no. 
The feeling drifted over Nanny that Walter was trying to put across some sort of message. Er, uh, what sort of lies would it be wrong to tell, Walter? Walter's eyes bulged. Lies about things you see, Mrs. Ogg, even if you did see them. Nanny thought it was probably time to present the Oggish point of view. It's all right to tell lies if you don't think lies, she said. He said our mum would lose our job and I'd be locked up if I said Mrs. Ogg. Did he? Which he was he? The ghost, Mrs. Ogg. I reckon Granny ought to have a good look at you, Walter, said Nanny. I reckon your mind's all tangled up like a ball of string what's been dropped. She pedalled the harmonium thoughtfully. Was it the ghost that wrote all this music, Walter? It's wrong to tell lies about the room with the sacks in it, Mrs. Ogg. Ah, thought Nanny, that'd be down here, would it? He said I wasn't to tell anyone. Who did? The ghost, Mrs. Ogg. But you're the... Nanny began, and then tried another way. Ah, but I ain't anyone, she said. Anyway, if you was to go to this room with the sacks and I was to follow you, that wouldn't be telling anyone, would it? It wouldn't be your fault if some old woman followed you, would it? Walter's face was an agony of indecision, but erratic though his thinking might have been, it was no match for Nanny Ogg's meretricious duplicity. He was up against a mind that regarded truth as a reference point, but certainly not as a shackle. Nanny Ogg could think her way through a corkscrew in a tornado without touching the sides. Anyway, it's all right if it's me, she added for good measure. In fact, he probably meant to say, except for Mrs. Ogg, only he forgot. Slowly, Walter reached out and picked up a candle. Without saying a word, he walked out of the door and into the damp darkness of the cellars. Nanny Ogg followed him, her boots making squelching noises in the mud. It didn't seem like much of a distance. As far as Nanny could work out, they were no longer under the opera house, but it was hard to be sure. Their shadows danced around them and they walked through other rooms, even more dark and dripping than the ones they'd been in. Walter stopped in front of a pile of timber that glistened with rot and pulled a few of the spongy planks aside. There were some sacks neatly piled. Nanny kicked one and it broke. In the flickering candlelight all that she could really see were sparkles of light as the cascade poured out, but there was no mistaking the gentle metallic scraping of lots of money. Lots and lots of money. Enough money to suggest very clearly that it belonged to either a thief or a publisher, and there didn't seem to be any books around. What's this, Walter? It's the ghost's money, Mrs. Ogg. There was a square hole in the opposite corner of the room. Water glinted a few inches below. Beside the hole were half a dozen containers of various sorts, old biscuit tins, broken bowls and the like. There was a stick, or possibly a dead shrub, in each one. And those, Walter, what are those? Rose bushes, Mrs. Ogg. Down here? But nothing could grow. Nanny stopped. She squelched over to the pots. They'd been filled with muck scraped from the floor. The dead stems glistened with slime. Nothing could grow down here, of course. There was no light. Everything that grew needed something else to feed on. And she moved the candle closer and sniffed the fragrance. Yes, it was subtle, but it was there, roses in darkness. Well, my word, Walter Plinge, she said, always one for the surprises you are. Books were piled on Mr. Bucket's desk. What you're doing is wrong, Granny Weatherwax, said Agnes from the doorway. Granny glanced up. Wrong as living other people's lives for them, she said. As a matter of fact, there's something even worse than that, which is living other people's lives for yourself. That kind of wrong? Agnes said nothing. Granny Weatherwax couldn't know. Granny turned back to the books. Anyway, this only looks wrong. Appearances is deceiving. You just pay attention to watching the corridor, madam. She riffled through the bits of torn envelope and scribbled notes that seemed to be the Opera House's equivalent of proper accounts. It was a mess. In fact, it was more than a mess. It was far too much of a mess to be a real mess, because a real mess has occasional bits of coherence, bits of what might be called random order. Rather, it was the kind of erratic mess 
that suggested that someone had set out to be messy. Take the account books. They were full of tiny rows and columns, but someone hadn't thought it worthwhile to invest in lined paper and had handwriting that wandered a bit. There were 40 rows on the left-hand side, but only 36 by the time they reached the other side of the page. It was hard to spot because of the way your eyes watered. What are you doing? said Agnes, tearing her gaze away from the corridor. Amazing, said Granny. Some things he's entered twice, and I reckon there's a page here where someone's added up the month and taken away the time of day. I thought you didn't like books, said Agnes. I don't, said Granny, turning a page. They can look you right in the face and still lie. How many fiddle players are there in the band? I think there are nine violinists in the orchestra. The correction appeared to pass unnoticed. Well, there's a thing, said Granny, without moving her head. Seems that twelve of them are drawing wages, but three of them is over the page, so you mightn't notice. She looked up and rubbed her hands happily. Unless you've got a good memory, that is. She ran a skinny finger down another erratic column. What's a flying ratchet? I don't know. It says here, repairs to flying ratchet, new springs for rotation cog assembly and making good. Hundred and sixty dollars and sixty-three pence. Huh. She licked her finger and tried another page. Even Nanny ain't this bad at numbers, she said. To be this bad at numbers, you've got to be good. Whew. No wonder this place never makes any money. You might as well try to fill a sieve. Agnes darted into the room. There's someone coming. Granny got up and blew out the lamp. You get behind the curtains, she commanded. What are you going to do? Oh, uh, I'll just have to make myself inconspicuous. Agnes hurried across to the big window and turned to look at Granny, who was standing by the fireplace. The old witch faded. She didn't disappear. She merely slid into the background. An arm gradually became part of the mantelpiece. A fold of her dress was a piece of shadow. An elbow became the top of the chair behind her. Her face became one with a vase of faded flowers. She was still there, like the old woman in the puzzle picture they sometimes printed in the almanac, where you could see the old woman or the young girl, but not both at once, because one was made of the shadows of the other. Granny Weatherwax was standing by the fireplace, but you could see her only if you knew she was there. Agnes blinked, and there were just the shadows and chair and the fire. The door opened. She ducked behind the curtains, feeling as conspicuous as a strawberry in a stew, certain that the sound of her heart would give her away. The door shut carefully, with barely a click. Footsteps crossed the floor. A wooden scraping noise might have been a chair being moved slightly. A scratch and a hiss were the sound of a match striking. A clink was the glass of the lamp being lifted. All noise ceased. Agnes crouched, every muscle suddenly screaming with the strain. The lamp hadn't been lit. She'd have seen the light around the curtain. Someone out there was making no noise. Someone out there was suddenly suspicious. A floorboard squeaked very slowly as someone shifted their weight. She felt as if she was going to scream or burst with the effort of silence. The handle of the window behind her, a mere point of pressure a moment ago, was trying seriously to become part of her life. Her mouth was so dry that she knew it would creak like a hinge if she dared to swallow. It couldn't be anyone who had a right to be here. People who had a right to be in places walked around noisily. The handle was getting really personal. Try to think of something else. The curtain moved. Someone was standing on the other side of it. If her throat weren't so arid, she might be able to scream. She could feel the presence through the cloth. Any moment now, someone was going to twitch the curtain aside. She leapt, or as close to a leap as was feasible. It was a kind of vertical lumber, billowing the curtain aside, colliding with a slim body behind it, and ending on the floor in a tangle of limbs and ripping velvet. She gulped air and pressed down on the squirming bundle below her. I'll scream, she said, and if I do, your eardrums will come down your nose. The writhing stopped. Frederica, said a muffled voice. Above her, the curtain rail sagged at one end, and the brass rings, one at a time, spun towards the floor. Nanny went back to the sacks. Each one bulged with round, hard shapes that clinked gently under her questing finger. This is a lot of money, Walter, she said carefully. Yes, Mrs. Og. 
Nanny lost track of money fairly easily, although this didn't mean the subject didn't interest her. It was just that, beyond a certain point, it became dreamlike. All she could be sure of was that the amount in front of her would make anyone's drawers drop. I suppose, she said, that if I was to ask you how it had got here, you'd say it was the ghost, yes? Like the roses. Yes, Mrs. Ogg. She gave him a worried look. You'll be all right down here, will you? she said. You'll sit quiet. I reckon I need to talk to some people. Where's my mum, Mrs. Ogg? She's having a nice sleep, Walter. Walter seemed satisfied with this. You'll sit quiet in your, in, in that room, will you? Yes, Mrs. Ogg. There's a good boy. She glanced at the money bags again. Money was trouble. Agnes sat back. Andre raised himself on his elbows and pulled the curtain off his face. What the hell were you doing there? he said. I was... What do you mean, what was I doing there? You were creeping around. You were hiding behind the curtain, said Andre, getting to his feet and fumbling for the matches again. Next time you blow out a lamp, remember it'll still be warm. We were on important business. The lamp glowed. Andre turned. We, he said. Agnes nodded and looked across at Granny. The witch hadn't moved, although it took a deliberate effort of will to focus on her among the shapes and shadows. Andre picked up the lamp and stepped forward. The shadows shifted. Well, he said. Agnes strode across the room and waved a hand in the air. There was the chair back, there was the vase, there was nothing else. But she was there. A ghost, eh? said Andre sarcastically. Agnes backed away. There is something about the light of a lamp held lower than someone's face. The shadows are wrong. They fall into unfortunate places. Teeth seem more prominent. Agnes came to realise that she was alone in a room in suspicious circumstances with a man whose face suddenly looked a lot more unpleasant than it had before. I suggest, he said, that you get back to the stage right now, yes? That would be the very best thing you could do, and don't meddle in things that don't concern you. You've done too much as it is. The fear hadn't drained out of Agnes, but it had found a space in which to metamorphose into anger. I don't have to put up with that. For all I know, you might be the ghost. Really? I was told that Walter Plinch was the ghost, said Andre. How many people did you tell? And now it turns out that he's dead. No, he's not. It was out before she could stop it. She'd said it merely to wipe the sneer off his face. This happened. But the expression that replaced it was no improvement. A floorboard creaked. They both turned. There was a hat stand in the corner next to a bookcase. There were a few coats and scarves hanging from it. It was surely only the way that the shadows fell that made it look, from this angle, like an old woman, or... Damn floors, said Granny, fading into the foreground. She stepped away from the coats. As Agnes said later, it wasn't as though she'd been invisible. She'd simply become part of the scenery until she put herself forward again. She was there, but not there. She didn't stand out at all. She was as unnoticeable as the very best of butlers. How did you get in? said Andre. I looked all round the room. Seeing is believing, said Granny calmly. Of course, the trouble is that believing is also seeing. And there's been too much of that around here lately. Now, I know you ain't the ghost, so what are you? To be sneaking around in places where you shouldn't be. I could ask you the same question. Me? I'm a witch. And I'm pretty good at it. She's, uh, uh from Lancre, where I come from. Agnes mumbled, trying to look at her feet. Oh, not the one who wrote the book, said Andre. I've heard people talking about... No, I'm much worse than her, understand? She is, mumbled Agnes. Andre gave Granny a long look, like a man weighing up his chances. He must have decided that they were bobbing along the ceiling. I hang around in dark places looking for trouble, he said. Really? There's a nasty name for people like that, snapped Granny. Yes, said Andre. It's policemen. Nanny Og climbed out of the cellars, rubbing her chin thoughtfully. Musicians and singers were still milling around, uncertain about what was going to happen next. The ghost had had the decency to be chased and killed during the interval. 
In theory, that meant there was no reason why there shouldn't be a third act, as soon as Herr Trubelmacher had scoured the nearby pubs and dragged the orchestra back. The show must go on. Yes, she thought, it has to go on. It's like the build-up to a thunderstorm. No, it's more like making love. Yes, that was a far more oggish metaphor. You put everything you've got into it, so sooner or later there's a point where it's got to go on, because you can't imagine stopping. The stage manager could dock a couple of dollars from their wages and they'd still go on, and everyone knew it, and they would still go on. She reached a ladder and climbed slowly into the flies. She hadn't been certain. She needed to be certain now. The fly loft was empty. She walked carefully along the catwalk until she was over the auditorium. The buzz of the audience came through the ceiling beneath her, slightly muffled. Light shone up at the point where the thick cable for the chandelier disappeared into the hole. She stepped out over the creaking trapdoor and peered down. Terrific heat almost frizzled her hair. A few yards below her, hundreds of candles were burning. Dreadful if that lot fell down, she said quietly. I expect this place would go up like a haystack. She let her gaze travel up and up the cable, to the point at just about waist height, where it was half cut through. You'd never see it if you weren't expecting to find it. Then her gaze dropped again and moved across the gloomy, dusty floor until it found something half hidden in the dust. Behind her, a shadow among the shadows rose to its feet, balanced itself carefully and started to run. I knows about policemen, said Granny. They've got big helmets and big feet, and you can see them a mile off. There's a couple lurching around backstage. Anyone can see their policemen. You don't look like one. She turned the badge over and over in her hands. I ain't happy with the idea of secret policemen, she said. Why do you need secret policemen? Because, said Andre, sometimes you have secret criminals. Granny almost smiled. That's a fact, she said. She peered at the small engraving on the back of the badge. Says here, Cable Street Particulars. There aren't many of us, said Andre. We've only just started. Commander Vimes said that since we can't do anything about the Thieves' Guild and the Assassins' Guild, we'd better look for other crimes, hidden crimes, that need watchmen with different skills. And I can play the piano quite well. What kind of skills have that troll and that dwarf got, said Granny. Seems to me the only thing they're really good at is standing around looking obvious and stupid. Ah, yes. Right. And they didn't even need much training, said Andre. Commander Vimes says that they're the most obvious policemen anyone could think of. Incidentally, Corporal Nobbs has got some papers to prove he's a human being. Forged? I don't think so. Granny Weatherwax put her head on one side. If your house was on fire, what's the first thing you'd take out of it? Oh, Granny, Agnes began. Hmm. Who set fire to it, said Andre. You're a policeman, right enough. Granny handed him his badge. You come to arrest poor Walter, she said. I know he didn't murder Dr. Undershaft. I was watching him. He was trying to unblock the privies all afternoon. I've had proof that Walter isn't the ghost, said Agnes. I was almost sure it was Selzella, said Andre. I know he creeps off to the cellars sometimes, and I'm sure he's stealing money, but the ghost has been seen when Salzella is perfectly visible. So now I think, 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 said Granny, someone thinking around here at last. How do you recognise the ghost, Mr. Policeman? Well, he's got a mask on. Really? Now, say it again and listen to what you say. Good grief, you can recognise him because he's got a mask on. You recognise him because you don't know who he is. Life isn't neat. Whoever said there's only one ghost? The figure ran through the shadows of the fly loft, cloak billowing round it. Nanny Og was outlined against the light peering down. She said without turning her head, Hello, Mr. Ghost. Come back for your saw, have ya? Then she darted around behind the cable until she faced the shadow. Millions of people knows I'm up here. You wouldn't hurt a little old lady, would you? Oh dear, me poor old heart. She keeled over backwards, hitting the floor hard enough to make the cable swing. The figure hesitated. Then it took a length of thin rope from a pocket and advanced cautiously towards the fallen witch. It knelt down, wound an end of the rope around each hand and leaned forward. Nanny's knee came up sharply. <gasps> Feels a lot better now, mister, she said as she reared backwards. She scrambled up again and grabbed the saw. 
come back to finish it, eh? She said, waving the implement in the air. Wonder how you'd blame that on Walter. Make you happy, would it, the old place burning down? The figure moving awkwardly backed away as she advanced. Then it turned, lurched along the wobbling catwalk and disappeared into the gloom. Nanny pounded after him and saw the figure climbing down a ladder. She looked around quickly, grabbed a rope to slide after him, and heard a pulley somewhere above start to clatter. She descended, skirts billowing around her. When she was about halfway down, a bunch of sandbags went upwards past her in a hurry. As she rattled onwards, she saw between her boots someone struggling with the trapdoor to the cellars. She landed a few feet away, still holding the rope. Mr. Salzella? Nanny stuck two fingers in her mouth and let out a whistle that could have melted earwax. She let go of the rope. Salzella glanced up at her as he raised the trapdoor and then saw the shape dropping out of the roof. One hundred and eighty pounds of sandbag hit the door, slamming it shut. Watch out, said Nanny cheerfully. Bucket waited nervously in the wings. Unnecessarily nervously, of course. The ghost was dead. There couldn't be anything to worry about. People said they'd seen him killed, although they were, Bucket had to admit, a bit hazy on the actual details. Nothing to worry about. Not a thing. Nothing whatsoever in any way. Everything was absolutely nothing to worry about in any way. He ran a finger around the inside of his collar. It hadn't been such a bad life in wholesale cheese. The most you had to worry about was one of poor old Reg Plenty's trouser buttons in the farmhouse Nutty, and the time young Weavins minced his thumb in the stirring machine, and it was only by luck they happened to be doing strawberry yoghurt at the time. A figure loomed up beside him. He clutched at a curtain for support, and then turned to see, with relief, the majestic and reassuring stomach of Enrico Basilica. The tenor looked magnificent in a huge cockerel costume, complete with giant beak, wattles and comb. Ah, uh, senor, Bucket burbled. Uh, very impressive, uh, may I say? See, si, said a muffled voice from somewhere behind the beak, as other members of the company hurried past onto the stage. May I say how, how sorry I am about all that business earlier? I can assure you that it, it doesn't happen every night. <laughs> See? Probably just high spirits. <laughs> the beak turned towards him. Bucket backed away. See? Si. Yes, well, I'm, I'm glad you're so understanding. Temperamental, he thought, as the tenor strode onto the stage, and the overture to Act Three drifted to its close. They're like that, real artistes. Nerves stretched like rubber bands, I expect. It's just like waiting for the cheese, really. You can get really edgy waiting to see whether you've got half a ton of best blue vein or just a vat full of pig food. It's probably like that when you've got an aria working its way up. Where'd he go? Where'd he go? What? Oh, uh, Mrs. Ock. The old woman waved a saw in front of his face. It was not, in Mr. Bucket's current state of mental tension, a helpful gesture. End of side 14. Side 15. He was suddenly surrounded by other figures, equally conducive to multiple exclamation marks. Perdita, wh why aren't you on stage? Oh, Lady Esmeralda, I didn't see you there. Of course, if, if you want to come backstage, you only have to... Where's Salzella? said Andre. Bucket looked around vaguely. He was here a few minutes ago, that is, uh, he said, pulling himself together. Mr. Salzella is probably attending to his uh, duties somewhere, which, young man, is, is more than I can say for... I demand you stop the show now, said Andre. Oh, you do, do you? And, and by what authority, may I ask? He's been sawing through the rope, said Nanny. Andre pulled out a badge. This. Bucket looked closely. Unc Morpork, Guild of Musicians, Member 1244. Andre glared at him, then at the badge, and started to pat his pockets urgently. No, blast, I know I had the other one a moment ago. Look, you've got to clear the theatre, we've got to search it, and that means... Don't stop the show, said Granny. I won't stop the show, said Bucket, because I reckon he'd like to see the show stopped. The show must go on, eh? Isn't that what you believe? Could he have got out of the building? I sent Corporal Nobbs to the stage door, and Sergeant Detritus is in the foyer, said Andre. When it comes to standing in doorways, they're among the best. Er, uh, um, 
Er, uh, excuse me, uh, what's happening? said Bucket. He could be anywhere, said Agnes. There are hundreds of hiding places. Who? said Bucket. How about these cellars everyone talks about? said Granny. Where? There's only one entrance, said Andre. He's not stupid. He can't get into the cellars, said Nanny. He ran off, probably in a cupboard somewhere by now. No, he'll stay where there's crowds, said Granny. That's what I'd do. What? said Bucket. Could he have got into the audience from here, said Nanny. Who? said Bucket. Granny jerked a thumb towards the stage. He's somewhere on there. I can feel him. Then we'll wait until he comes off. Eighty people coming off stage all at once, said Agnes. Don't you know what it's like when the curtain goes down? And we don't want to stop the show, Granny mused. No, we don't want to stop the show, said Bucket, grasping at a familiar idea as it swept by on a tide of incomprehensibility. Or give people their money back in any fashion whatsoever. Um, what are we talking about? Does anyone know? The show must go on, murmured Granny Weatherwax, still staring out of the wings. Things have to end right. This is an opera house. They should end operatically. Nanny Og hopped up and down excitedly. Oh, I know what you're thinking, Esme, she squeaked. Oh, yes, can we? Just so as I can say I've done it. Eh, can we? Go on, let's. Henry Lawsey peered closely at his opera notes. He had not, of course, fully understood the events of the first two acts, but knew that this was perfectly okay, because one would have to be quite naive to expect good sense as well as good songs. Anyway, it would all be explained in the last act, which was the masked ball in the Duke's palace. It would almost certainly turn out that the woman one of the men had been rather daringly courting would be his own wife, but so cunningly disguised by a very small mask that her husband wouldn't have spotted that she wore the same clothes and had the same hairstyle. Someone's serving man would turn out to be someone else's daughter in disguise. Someone would die of something that didn't prevent them from singing about it for several minutes. And the plot would be resolved by some coincidences which in real life would be as likely as a cardboard hammer. He didn't know any of this for a fact. He was making a calculated guess. In the meantime, Act Three opened with the traditional ballet, this time apparently a country dance by the maidens of the court. Henry was aware of muffled laughter around him. This was because if you ran an eye at head height along a row of ballerinas as they tripped arm in arm onto the stage, there was an apparent gap. This was only filled if the gaze went downwards a foot or two to a small, fat ballerina in a huge grin, an overstretched tutu, long white drawers, and boots. Henry stared. They were big boots. They moved back and forth at an astonishing speed. The satin slippers of the other dancers twinkled as they drifted across the floor, but the boots flashed and clattered like a tap dancer afraid of falling into the sink. The pirouettes were novel, too. While the other dancers whirled like snowflakes, the little fat one spun like a top and moved across the floor like one, too, bits of her anatomy trying to achieve local orbit. Around Henry, members of the audience were whispering to one another. Oh, yes, he heard someone declare. They tried this in Pseudopolis. His mother nudged him. Is this supposed to happen? Uh, I don't think so. It's bloody good, though. It's a good laugh. As the fat ballerina collided with a donkey in evening dress, she staggered and grabbed at his mask, which came off. Herr Trubelmacher, the conductor, froze in horror and astonishment. Around him, the orchestra rattled to a standstill, except for the tuba player. Oompa, 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 oompa who had memorised his score years ago and never took much interest in current affairs. Two figures rose up right in front of Trubelmucker. A hand grabbed his baton. Sorry, sir, said Andre, but the show must go on, yes? He handed the stick to the other figure. There you are, he said, and don't let them stop. Walk. The librarian carefully lifted Herr Trubelmucker aside with one hand, licked the baton thoughtfully, and then focused his gaze on the tuba player. Oompa, 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 mm. The tuba player tapped a trombonist on the shoulder. Hey, Frank, there's a monkey where the old troublemaker should be. Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Satisfied, the orangutan raised his arms. The orchestra looked up, and then looked up a bit more. No conductor in musical history, not even the one who once fried and ate the piccolo player's liver on a cymbal for one wrong note too many, not even the one who skewered three troublesome violinists on his baton, not even the one who made really hurtful, sarcastic remarks in a loud voice, 
was ever the focus of such reverential attention. On stage, Nanny Og took advantage of the hush to pull the head off a frog. Madam, sorry, thought you might be someone else. The long arms dropped, the orchestra in one huge muddle cord slammed back into life. The dancers, after a moment's confusion during which Nanny Og took the opportunity to decapitate a clown and a phoenix, tried to continue. The chorus watched in bemusement. Christine felt a tap on her shoulder and turned to see Agnes. Perdita, where have you been? she hissed. It's nearly time for my duet with Enrico. You've got to help, hissed Agnes. But down in her soul, Perdita said, Enrico, eh? It's Signor Basilica to everyone else. Help you what? said Christine. Take everyone's masks off. Christine's forehead wrinkled beautifully. That's not supposed to happen until the end of the opera, is it? Uh, it's all been changed, said Agnes urgently. She turned to a nobleman in a zebra mask and tugged it desperately. The singer underneath glared at her. Sorry, she whispered, I thought you were someone else. We're not supposed to take them off until the end. It's been changed. Has it? No one told me. A short-necked giraffe next to him leaned sideways. What's that? The big unmasking scene is now, apparently. No one told me. Yes, but when does anyone tell us anything? We're only the chorus. Here, why is old Troublemaker wearing a monkey mask? Nanny Og pirouetted past, cannoned into an elephant in evening dress, and beheaded him by the trunk. She whispered, We're looking for the ghost, see? But the ghost is dead, isn't he? Hard things to kill, ghosts, said Nanny. The whisper spread outwards from that point. There is nothing like a chorus for rumour. People who would not believe a high priest if he said the sky was blue and was able to produce signed affidavits to this effect from his white-haired old mother and three vestal virgins would trust just about anything whispered darkly behind their hand by a complete stranger in a pub. A cockatoo spun around and pulled the mask off a parrot. Bucket sobbed. This was worse than the day the buttermilk exploded. This was worse than the flash heat wave that had led a whole warehouse full of Lonkra extra strong to riot. The opera had turned into a pantomime. The audience was laughing. About the only character still with a mask on was Signor Basilica, who was watching the struggling chorus with as much aloof amazement as his own mask could convey, and this, amazingly enough, was quite a lot. Oh, no, moaned Bucket. We'll never live it down. He'll never come back. It'll be all over the opera circuit, and no one will ever want to come here ever again. Ever again what? mumbled a voice behind him. Bucket turned. Oh, Signor Basilica, he said. Didn't see you there. I was just thinking, I do hope you don't think this is typical. Signor Basilica stared through him, swaying slightly from side to side. He was wearing a torn shirt. Someone, he said. Uh, I'm sorry. Someone. Someone. Hit me on the head, said the tenor. Ah, I want a glass of water, please. But you're just about to, to sing, aren't you, said Bucket. He grabbed the stunned man by the collar to pull him closer, but this simply meant that he dragged himself off the floor, bringing his shoes about level with Basilica's knees. Tell me, tell me you're out there on the stage, please. Even in his stunned state, Enrico Basilica, a.k.a. Henry Slug, recognised what might be called the essential dichotomy of the statement. He stuck to what he knew. Someone bashed me in a corridor, he volunteered. That's n not you out there? Basilica blinked heavily. Oh, not me. You're going to sing the famous duet in a moment. Another thought staggered through Basilica's abused skull. Mm, my, he said, that's good. I'll look forward to that. Never had a chance to hear me before. He gave a happy little sigh and fell full length backwards. Bucket leaned against a pillar for support. Then his brow furrowed, and in the best traditions of the extended double-take, he stared at the fallen tenor and counted to one on his fingers. Then he turned towards the stage and counted to two. He could feel a fourth exclamation mark coming on any time now. The Enrico Basilica on stage turned his mask this way and that. Stage right, Bucket was whispering to a group of stagehands. Stage left, Andre, the secret pianist, was waiting. A large troll loomed next to him. The fat red singer walked to centre stage as the prelude to the duet began. The audience settled down again. Fun and games among the chorus was all very well. It might even be in the plot, 
but this was what they'd paid for. This was what it was all about. Agnes stared at him as Christine walked towards him. Now she could see he wasn't right. Oh, he was fat, in a pillow-up-your-shirt sort of a way, but he didn't move like Basilica. Basilica moved lightly on his feet, as fat men often do, giving the effect of a barely tethered balloon. She glanced at Nanny, who was also watching him carefully. She couldn't see Granny Weatherwax anywhere. That probably meant she was really close. The expectancy of the audience dragged at them all. Ears opened like paddles. The fourth wall of the stage, the big black sucking darkness outside, was a well of silence begging to be filled up. Christine was walking towards him, quite unconcerned. Christine would walk into a dragon's mouth if it had a sign on it saying, Totally harmless, I promise you. At least, if it was printed in large, easy-to-understand letters. No one seemed to want to do anything. It was a famous duet, and a beautiful one. Agnes ought to know she'd been singing it all last night. Christine took the false basilica's hand, and as the opening bars of the duet began, opened her mouth. Stop right there! Agnes put everything she could into it. The chandelier tinkled. The orchestra went silent in a skid of wheezes and twangs. In a fading of chords and a dying of echoes, the show stopped. Walter Plinge sat in the candlelit gloom under the stage, his hands resting on his lap. It was not often that Walter Plinge had nothing to do, but when he did have nothing to do, he did nothing. He liked it down here. It was familiar. The sounds of the opera filtered through. They were muffled, but that didn't matter. Walter knew all the words, every note of music, every step of every dance. He needed the actual performances only in the same way that a clock needs its tiny little escapement mechanism. It kept him ticking nicely. Mrs. Plinge had taught him to read using the old programmes. That's how he knew he was part of it all. But he knew that anyway. He'd cut what teeth he had on a helmet with horns on it. The first bed he could remember was the very same trampoline used by Dame Jiggly in the infamous Bouncing Jiggly incident. Walter Plinge lived opera. He breathed its songs, painted its scenery, lit its fires, washed its floors and shined its shoes. Opera filled up places in Walter Plinge that might otherwise have been empty. And now, the show had stopped. But all the energy, all the raw pent-up emotion that is dammed up behind a show, all the screaming, the fears, the hopes, the desires, flew on like a body hurled from the wreckage. The terrible momentum smashed into Walter Plinge like a tidal wave hitting a teacup. It propelled him out of his chair and flung him against the crumbling scenery. He slid down and rolled into a twitching heap on the floor, clapping his hands over his ears to shut out the sudden unnatural silence. A shape stepped out of the shadows. Granny Weatherwax had never heard of psychiatry and would have had no truck with it even if she had. There are some arts too black even for a witch. She practised headology, practised in fact until she was very good at it. And though there may be some superficial similarities between a psychiatrist and a headologist, there is a huge practical difference. A psychiatrist, dealing with a man who fears he is being followed by a large and terrible monster, will endeavour to convince him that the monsters don't exist. Granny Weatherwax would simply give him a chair to stand on and a very heavy stick. Stand up, Walter Plinge, she said. Walter stood up, staring straight ahead of him. It stopped! It stopped! It's bad luck to stop the show, he said hoarsely. Someone better start it again, said Granny. You can't stop the show. It's the show. Yes, someone better start it again, Walter Plinge. Walter didn't appear to notice her. He poured aimlessly through his stack of music and ran his hands through the drifts of old programmes. One hand touched the keyboard of the harmonium and played a few neurotic notes. Wrong to stop. Show must go on. Mr. Salzella is trying to stop the show, isn't he, Walter? Walter's head shot up. He stared straight ahead of him. You haven't seen anything, Walter Plinge, he said, in a voice so like Salzella's that even Granny raised an eyebrow. And if you tell lies, you will be locked up and I'll see to it that there's big trouble for your mother. Granny nodded. He found out about the ghost, didn't he? She said. The ghost who comes out when he has a mask on. Doesn't he, Walter Plinge? And the man thought, I can use that. 
And when it's time for the ghost to be caught, well, there is a ghost that can be caught. And the best thing is that everyone will believe it. They'll feel bad about themselves, maybe, but they'll believe it. Even Walter Plinge won't be certain, because his mind's all tangled up. Granny took a deep breath. It's tangled, but it ain't twisted. There was a sigh. Well, matters will have to resolve themselves. There's nothing else for it. She removed her hat and fished around in the point. I don't mind telling you this, Walter, she said, because you won't understand and you won't remember. There was a wicked old witch once called Black Alice. She was an unholy terror. There's never been one worse or more powerful. Until now. Because I could spit in her eye and steal her teeth, see? Because she didn't know right from wrong. So she got all twisted up. And that was the end of her. The trouble is, you see, that if you do know right from wrong, you can't choose wrong. You just can't do it and live. So, if I was a bad witch, I could make Mr. Salzella's muscles turn against his bones and break them where he stood. If I was bad. I could do things inside his head, change the shape he thinks he is, and he'd be down on what had been his knees and begging to be turned into a frog. If I was bad... I could leave him with a mind like a scrambled egg, listening to colours and hearing smells, if I was bad. Oh, yes. There was another sigh, deeper and more heartfelt. But I can't do none of that stuff. That wouldn't be right. She gave a deprecating little chuckle, and if Nanny Og had been listening, she would have resolved as follows, that no maddened cackle from Black Alice of infamous memory, no evil little giggle from some crazed vampire whose morals were worse than his spelling, no side-splitting guffaw from the most inventive torturer, was quite so unnerving as a happy little chuckle from a Granny Weatherwax about to do what's best. From the point of her hat, Granny withdrew a paper-thin mask. It was a simple face, smooth, white, basic. There were semicircular holes for the eyes. It was neither happy nor sad. She turned it over in her hands. Walter seemed to stop breathing. Simple thing, ain't it? said Granny. Looks beautiful, but it's really just a simple bit of stuff, just like any other mask. Wizards could poke at this for a year and still say there was nothing magic about it, hmm? Which just shows how much they know, Walter Plinge. She tossed it to him. He caught it hungrily and pulled it over his face. Then he stood up in one flowing movement, moving like a dancer. I don't know what you are when you're behind the mask, said Granny, but ghost is just another word for spirit, and spirit is just another word for soul. Off you go, Walter Plinge. The masked figure did not move. I meant, off you go, ghost. The show must go on. The mask nodded and darted away. Granny slapped her hands together like the crack of doom. Right. Let's do some good, she said to the universe at large. Everyone was looking at her. This was a moment in time, a little point between the past and the future, when a second could stretch out and out. Agnes felt the blush begin. It was heading for her face like the revenge of the volcano god. When it got there, she knew it would be all over for her. You'll apologise, Perdita jeered. Shut up! shouted Agnes. She strode forward before the echo had had time to come back from the further ends of the auditorium and wrenched at the red mask. The entire chorus came in on cue. This was opera, after all. The show had stopped, but opera continued. Salzella! He grabbed Agnes, clamping his hand over her mouth. His other hand flew to his belt and drew his sword. It wasn't a stage prop. The blade hissed through the air as he spun to face the chorus. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, he said. How extremely operatic of me. And now I fear I shall have to take this poor girl hostage. It's the appropriate thing to do, isn't it? He looked around triumphantly. The audience watched in fascinated silence. Isn't anyone going to say, you won't get away with this, he said. You won't get away with this, said Andre from the wings. You have the place surrounded, I have no doubt said Salzella brightly. Yes, we have the place surrounded. Christine screamed and fainted. Salzella smiled even more brightly. Ah, now there's someone operatic, he said. But you see, I am going to get away with it because I don't think operatically. 
Myself and this young lady here are going to go down to the cellars where I may possibly leave her unharmed. I doubt very much that you have the cellars surrounded. Even I don't know everywhere they go, and believe me, my knowledge is really rather extensive. He paused. Agnes tried to break free, but his grip tightened around her neck. By now, he said, someone should have said, but why, Salzella? Honestly, do I have to do everything round here? Bucket realised he had his mouth open. That's what I was going to say, he said. Ah, good. Well, in that case, I should say something like, because I wanted to. Because I rather like money, you see. But more than that, he took a deep breath, I really hate opera. I don't want to get needlessly excited about this, but opera, I am afraid, really is dreadful. And I have had enough. So while I have the stage, let me tell you what a wretched, self-adoring, totally unrealistic, worthless art form it is. What a terrible waste of fine music. What a... There was a whir off one side of the stage. The skirts of costumes began to flap. Dust flew up. Andre looked around. Beside him, the wind machine had started up. The handle was turning by itself. Salzella turned to see what everyone was staring at. The ghost had dropped lightly onto the stage. His opera cloak billowed around him operatically. He bowed slightly and drew his sword. But you're dead, Salzella began. Oh, yes, a ghost of a ghost. Totally unbelievable and an offence against common sense in the best operatic tradition. This was really too much to hope for. He thrust Agnes away and nodded happily. That's what opera does to a man, he said. It rots the brain, you see, and I doubt whether he had too much of that to begin with. It drives people mad! Mad! Do you hear me? Mad! <clears throat> they act irrationally. Don't you think I've watched you over the years? It's like a hothouse for insanity. Do you hear me? Insanity! He and the ghost began to circle one another. You don't know what it's been like, I assure you, being the only sane man in this madhouse. You believe anything! You'd prefer to believe a ghost can be in two places at once than that there might simply be two people. Even Pounder thought he could blackmail me, poking around in places that he shouldn't. Well, of course, I had to kill him for his own good. This place sends even rat catchers mad. And Undershaft, well, why couldn't he have forgotten his glasses like he usually did, hm? He lashed out with his sword. The ghost parried. And now I'll fight your ghost, he said, moving forward in a flurry of strokes. And you'll notice that our ghost here doesn't actually know how to fence, because he only knows stage fencing, you see. <gasps> Where the whole point, of course, is simply to hit the other fellow's sword with a suitably impressive metallic noise so that you can die very dramatically, merely because he's carefully thrust his sword under your armpit. The ghost was forced to retreat under the onslaught until he fell backwards over the unconscious body of Christine. See, said Salzella, that's what comes of believing in opera. He reached down quickly and tugged the mask off Walter Plinge's face. Really, Walter, you are a bad boy. Sorry, Mr. Salzella. Look how everyone's staring. Sorry, Mr. Salzella. The mask crumpled in Salzella's fingers. He let the fragments tumble to the floor. Then he pulled Walter to his feet. See, company, this is your luck. This is your ghost. Without his mask, he's just an idiot who can hardly tie his shoelaces. <laughs> <laughs> it's all your fault, Walter Plinge. Yes, Mr. Salzella. No! Salzella looked around. No one would believe Walter Plinge. Even Walter Plinge gets confused about the things Walter Plinge sees. Even his mother was afraid he might have murdered people. People could accept just about anything of a Walter Plinge. There was a steady tapping noise. The trap door opened beside Salzella. A pointy hat appeared, slowly, followed by the rest of Granny Weatherwax with her arms folded. She glared at Salzella as the floor clicked into place. Her foot stopped tapping on the boards. 
Well, well, he said. Lady Esmeralda, eh? I'm stopping being a lady, Mr. Salzella. He glanced up at the pointy hat. So you are a witch instead? Yes, indeed. A bad witch, no doubt. Worse. But this, said Salzella, is a sword. Everyone knows witches can't magic iron and steel. Get out of my way. The sword hissed down. Granny thrust out her hand. There was a blur of flesh and steel, and she held the sword by the blade. Tell you what, Mr. Salzella, she said levelly, it ought to be Walter Plinge who finishes this, eh? It's him you harmed, apart from the ones you murdered, of course. You didn't need to do that. But you wore a mask, didn't you? There's a kind of magic in masks. Masks conceal one face, but they reveal another. The one that only comes out in darkness. I bet you could do just what you liked behind a mask. Salzella blinked at her. He pulled on his sword, tugged hard on a sharp blade held in an unprotected hand. There was a groan from several members of the chorus. Granny grinned. Her knuckles whitened as she redoubled her grip. She turned her head towards Walter Plinge. Put your mask on, Walter. Everyone looked down at the crumpled cardboard on the stage. Don't have one any more, Mistress Weatherwax. Granny followed his gaze. Oh, deary, deary me, she said. Well, I can see we shall have to do something about that. Look at me, Walter. He did as he was told. Granny's eyes half closed. You trust Perdita, don't you, Walter? Yes, Mistress Weatherwax. That's good, because she's got a new mask for you, Walter Plinge. A magic one. It's just like your old one, you see, only you wear it under your skin. And you don't have to take it off. And no one but you will ever need to know it's there. Got it, Perdita? But I... Got it? Uh, oh, yes, here it is, yes. I've got it in my hand. She waved an empty hand vaguely. You're holding it the wrong way up, my girl. Oh, sorry. Well, give it to him then. Er, uh, yes. Agnes advanced on Walter. Now you take it, Walter, said Granny, still gripping the sword. Yes, Mistress Weatherwax. He reached out towards Agnes. As he did so, she was sure that just for a moment there was a faint pressure on her fingertips. Well, put it on. Walter looked uncertain. You do believe there's a mask there, don't you, Walter? Granny demanded. Perdita's sensible and she knows an invisible mask when she sees one. He nodded slowly and raised his hands to his face. And Agnes was sure that he'd somehow come into focus. Almost certainly nothing had happened that could be measured with any kind of instrument, any more than you could weigh an idea or sell good fortune by the yard. But Walter stood up, smiling faintly. Good, said Granny. She stared at Salzella. I reckon you two should fight again, she said. But it can't be said I'm unfair. I expect you've got a ghost mask somewhere. Mrs. Ogg saw you waving it, see? And she's not as gormless as she looks. Thank you, said a fat ballerina. So, she thought, how could people still say afterwards that they'd seen the ghost? Cause that's how you recognise the ghost, by his mask. So, there's two masks. Under her gaze, telling himself that he could resist any time he wanted to, Salzella reached into his jacket and produced his own mask. Put it on, then, she let go of the sword. Then who you are can fight who he is. Down in the pit, the percussionist stared as his sticks rose and began a drum roll. Are you doing that, Githa? said Granny Weatherwax. I thought you were. It's opera, then. The show must go on. Walter Plinge raised his sword. The masked Salzella glanced from him to Granny and then lunged. The swords met. It was, Agnes realised, stage fighting. The swords clashed and rattled as the fighters danced back and forth across the stage. Walter wasn't trying to hit Salzella. Every thrust was parried. Every opportunity to strike back, as the director of music grew more angry, was ignored. This isn't fighting, Salzella shouted, standing back. This is Walter Thrust. Salzella staggered away until he cannoned into Nanny Og. He lurched sideways, then he staggered forward, dropped onto one knee, got unsteadily to his feet again, and staggered into the centre of the stage. Whatever happens, he gasped, wrenching off his mask, it can't be worse than a season of opera. 
I don't mind where I'm going so long as there are no fat men pretending to be thin boys and no huge long songs which everyone says are so beautiful just because they don't understand what the hell they're actually about. Ah, ah. He slumped to the floor. But Walter didn't, Agnes began. Shut up, said Nanny Og out of the corner of her mouth. But he, he hasn't, Bucket began. Incidentally, another thing I can't stand about opera, said Salzella, rising to his feet and reeling crabwise towards the curtains, are the plots. They make no sense. And no one ever says so. And the quality of the acting, it's non-existent. Everyone stands around watching the person who's singing. Ye gods, it's going to be a relief to put that behind. Ah, ah, ah. Ah, he slumped to the floor. Is that it? said Nanny. Shouldn't think so, said Granny Weatherwax. As for the people who attend opera, said Salzella, struggling upright again and staggering sideways, I think I just possibly hate them even worse. They're so ignorant. There's hardly a one of them out there who knows the first thing about music. They go on about tunes. They spend all day endeavouring to be sensible human beings and then they walk in here and they leave their intelligence on a nail by the door. Then why didn't you just leave, snapped Agnes. If you'd stolen all this money, why didn't you just go away somewhere if you hated it so much? Salzella stared at her while swaying back and forth. His mouth opened and shut once or twice as if he were trying out unfamiliar words. Leave, he managed. Leave? Leave the opera? Uh, 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 uh. He hit the floor again. André prodded the fallen director. Is he dead yet? He said. How can he be dead? said Agnes. Good grief. Can't anyone see that... You know what really gets me down? said Salzella, rising to his knees. Is the way that in opera everyone takes such a long... Time to... Uh, 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 he keeled over. End of side 15. Side 16 The company waited for a while. The audience held its collective breath. Nanny Og poked him with a boot. Yep, that's about it. Looks like he's gone down for the last curtain call, she said. But Walter didn't stab him, said Agnes. Why won't anyone listen? Look, the sword isn't even sticking in him. It's just tucked between his body and his arm, for heaven's sake. Yes, said Nanny. I suppose, really, it's a shame he didn't notice that. She scratched at her shoulder. Here, these ballet dresses really tickle. But he's dead. Got a bit overexcited, perhaps, said Nanny, fidgeting with a strap. Overexcited? Frantic. You know these artistic types. Well, you are one, of course. He's, he's, um, uh, really dead, said Bucket. Seems to be, said Granny. One of the best operatic deaths ever, I wouldn't mind betting. Th 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 that's terrible. Bucket grabbed the former Salzella by the collar and hauled him upright. Where's my money? Come on out with it. Tell me what you've done with my money. I don't hear you. He's not saying anything. That's on account of being dead, said Granny. Not talkative, the deceased, as a rule. Well, you're a witch. Can't you do that thing with the cards and the glasses? Well, yes, we could have a poker game, said Nanny. Good idea. The money is in the cellars, said Granny. Walter will show you. Walter Plinge clicked his heels. Certainly, he said. I would be glad to. Bucket stared. It was Walter Plinge's voice, and it was coming out of Walter Plinge's face, but both face and voice were different, subtly different. The voice had lost the uncertain, frightened edge. The lopsided look had gone from the face. Good grief, Bucket murmured, and let go of Salzella's coat. There was a thump. And since you're going to be needing a new director of music, said Granny, you could do a lot worse than look to Walter here. 
Ooh, Walter? He knows everything there is to know about opera, said Granny, and everything about the opera house too. You should see the music he's written, said Nanny. Walter? Musical director? said Bucket. Stuff you can really hum. Yes, I think you might be surprised, said Granny. There's one with lots of sailors dancing around singing about how there's no women. The, 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 this is Walter, isn't it? And then some bloke called Les, who's miserable all the time. Oh, this is Walter, said Granny, the same person. And there's one with all cats leaping around all singing. That was fun, Nanny burbled. Can't imagine how he thought up that one. Bucket scratched his chin. He was feeling light-headed enough as it was. And he's trustworthy, said Granny, and he's honest, and he knows all about the opera house, as I said, and where everything is. That was enough for Mr. Bucket. Ah, uh, want to be the uh, director of music, Walter, he said. Thank you, Mr. Bucket, said Walter Plinge. I should like that very much. But what about cleaning the privies? Sorry? I won't have to stop doing them, will I? I've just got them working right. Oh, right, really? Mr. Bucket's eyes crossed for a moment. Well, fine, you can sing while you're doing it, if you like, he added generously, and I won't even cut your pay. I'll, I'll, I'll raise it. Six, no, no, seven shiny dollars. Walter rubbed his face thoughtfully. Mr. Bucket? Yes, Walter? I think you paid Mr. Salzella... Forty shiny dollars. Bucket turned to Granny. Eh, is he some kind of monster? You just listen to the stuff he's been writing, said Nanny. Amazing songs, not even in foreign. Will you just look at his stuff? Excuse me. She turned her back on the audience. Twing, twang, twong, and twirled around again with a wad of music paper in her hands. I know good music when I sees it she said, handing it to Bucket and pointing excitedly at extracts. It's got blobs and curly bits all over it, see? You have been writing this music, said Bucket to Walter, which is, hmm, unaccountably warm. Indeed, Mr. Bucket. In, in my time? There's a lovely song here, said Nanny. Don't cry for me, Genua. It's very sad. That reminds me, I'd better go and see if Mrs. Plinge has come round as a, as a, <coughs> woken up. I may have overdone it a bit on the scumble. She ambled off, twitching at bits of her costume, and nudged a fascinated ballerina. This balletting doesn't have to make you sweat, don't you find? Excuse me, there's something I didn't quite believe, said Andre. He took Salzella's sword and tested the blade carefully. Ow, he shouted. Sharp, is it, said Agnes. Yes, Andre sucked his thumb. She caught it in her hand. She's a witch, said Agnes, but it was steel. I thought no one could magic steel. Everyone knows that. I wouldn't be too impressed if I was you, said Agnes sourly. It was probably just some kind of trick. Andre turned to Granny. Your hand isn't even scratched. How did you... Her stare held him in its sapphire vice for a moment. When he turned away, he looked vaguely puzzled, like a man who can't remember where he's just put something down. I hope it didn't hurt Christine, he mumbled. Why isn't anyone seeing to her? Probably because she makes sure she screams and faints before anything happens, said Perdita through Agnes. Andre set off across the stage. Agnes trailed after him. A couple of dancers were kneeling down next to Christine. It'd be terrible if anything happened to her, said Andre. Oh, yes. Everyone says she's showing such promise. Walter stepped up beside him. Yes. We should get her somewhere, he said. His voice was clipped and precise. Agnes felt the bottom start to drop out of her world. Yes, but you know it was me doing the singing. Oh, yes, uh, yes, of course, said Andre, awkwardly. But, well, this is opera, you know. Walter took her hand. But it was me you taught, she said desperately. Then you were very good, said Walter. I suspect she will never be quite that good, even with many months of my tuition. But, Perdita, have you ever heard of the words star quality? Is it the same as talent? snapped Agnes. It is rarer. She stared at him. His face, however it was controlled now, was quite handsome in the glare of the footlights. She pulled her hand free. I liked you better when you were Walter Plinge, she said. Agnes turned away and felt Granny Weatherwax's gaze on her. She was sure it was a mocking gaze. 
Uh, we ought to get Christine into Mr. Bucket's office, Andre said. This seemed to break some sort of spell. Uh, y yes, indeed, said Bucket, and we can't leave Mr. Salzella corpsing on the stage either. Uh, uh, you two, you'd better take him backstage. Uh, the rest of you, well, it was nearly over anyway. Uh, um, that's it. The uh, opera is over. Walter Plinge? Nanny Og entered, supporting Mrs. Plinge. Walter's mother fixed him with a beady gaze. Have you been a bad boy? Mr. Bucket walked over to her and patted her hand. I think you'd better come along to my office too, he said. He handed the sheaf of music to Andre, who opened it at random. Andre gave it a glance and then stared. Hey, this is good, he said. Is it? Andre looked at another page. Good heavens! What? What? said Bucket. I've just never... I mean, I mean, even I can see. Tum -ti -tum, tum -tum. Yes, Mr. Bucket, you know this isn't opera. There's music and, and yes, dancing and singing all right, but it's not opera. Not opera at all. A long way from opera. Uh, how far? You don't mean, Bucket hesitated, savouring the idea, you don't mean that it's just possible that you put music in and, 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 and you get money out. Andre hummed a few bars. This could very well be the case, Mr. Bucket. Bucket beamed. He put one arm around Andre and the other around Walter. Good, he said. This calls for a very large, um, <clears throat> for a medium-sized drink. One by one, or in groups, the singers and dancers left the stage, and the witches and Agnes were left alone. Is that it? said Agnes. Not quite yet, said Granny. Someone staggered onto the stage. A kindly hand had bandaged Enrico Basilica's head, and presumably another kindly hand had given him the plate of spaghetti he was holding. Mild concussion still seemed to have him in its grip. He blinked at the witches, and then spoke like a man who'd lost his hold on immediate events, and so was clinging hard to more ancient considerations. Someone give me some sketty, he said. That's nice, said Nanny. <laughs> Getty is fine for him likes it, but not me. <laughs> yes. He turned and peered muzzily at the darkness of the audience. You know what I'm going to do? You know what I'm going to do now? I'm saying goodbye to Enrico Basilica. Oh, yes. He's chewed his last tentacle. I'm going to go right out now and have eight pints of turbots really odd. Yes. And probably a sausage in a bun. And then I'm going to go down to the music hall to hear Nellie Stamp sing A Winkle's No Use If You Don't Have a Pin. And if I sing again here, it's going to be under the proud old name of Henry Slug. Do you hear? There was a shriek from somewhere in the audience. Henry Slug? Uh, yes? I thought it was you. You've grown a beard and stuffed a haystack down your trousers, but I thought under that little mask, that's my Henry, that was. Henry Slug shaded his eyes from the footlight's glare. Angeline? Oh, no, said Agnes wearily. This sort of thing does not happen. Happens in the theatre all the time, said Nanny Og. It certainly does, said Granny. It's only a mercy he doesn't have a long-lost twin brother. There was the sound of much scuffling in the audience. Someone was climbing along a row, dragging someone else. Mother, came a voice from the gloom, what do you think you are doing? You just come with me, young Henry. Mother, we can't go up on the stage. Henry Slug frisbeed the plate into the wings, clambered down from the stage and heaved himself over the edge of the orchestra pit, assisted by a couple of violinists. They met... At the first row of seats, Agnes could just hear their voices. Oh, I, I, I meant to come back, you know that. I, I wanted to wait, ah, what with one thing and another, especially eh, one thing. Eh, come here, young Henry. Mother, what is happening? Son, you know I always said your father was Mr. Lawsey the eel juggler? Yes, of course. Please, uh, both of you, come back to my dressing room. I can see we've got such a lot to talk about. Oh, yes, a lot. Agnes watched them go. The audience, who could spot opera even if it wasn't being sung, applauded. All right, she said, and now is it the end? 
Nearly, said Granny. Did you do something to everyone's heads? No, but I felt like smacking a few, said Nanny. But no one said thank you or anything. Often the case, said Granny. Too busy thinking about the next performance, said Nanny. The show must go on, she added. That's, that's madness. It's opera. I noticed that even Mr. Bucket's caught it too, said Nanny. And that young Andre has been rescued from being a policeman, if I'm any judge. But what about me? Oh, them as makes the endings don't get them, said Granny. She brushed an invisible speck of dust off her shoulder. I expect we'd better be getting along, Githa, she said, turning her back on Agnes. Early start tomorrow. Nanny walked forward, shading her eyes as she stared out into the dark moor of the auditorium. The audience haven't gone, you know, she said. They're still sitting out there. Granny joined her and peered into the gloom. I can't imagine why, she said. He did say the opera's over. They turned and looked at Agnes, who was standing in the centre of the stage and glowering at nothing. Feeling a bit angry, said Nanny, only to be expected. Yes. Feeling that everything's happened for other people and not you? Yes. But, said Granny Weatherwax, look at it like this. What's Christine got to look forward to? She'll just become a singer. Stuck in a little world. Oh, maybe she'll be good enough to get a little fame, but one day the voice will crack and that's the end of her life. You have got a choice. You can either be on the stage, just a performer, just going through the lines, or you can be outside it and know how the script works, where the scenery hangs and where the trapdoors are. Isn't that better? No. The infuriating thing about Nanny Og and Granny Weatherwax, Agnes thought later, was the way they sometimes acted in tandem, without exchanging a word. Of course, there were plenty of other things. The way they never thought that meddling was meddling if they did it. The way they automatically assumed that everyone else's business was their own. The way they went through life in a straight line. The way, in fact, that they arrived in any situation and immediately started to change it. Compared to that, acting on unspoken agreement was a mere minor annoyance. But it was here and up close. They walked towards her and each laid a hand on her shoulder. Feeling angry, said Granny. Yes. I should let it out then if I was you, said Nanny. Agnes shut her eyes, clenched her fists, opened her mouth and screamed. It started low. Plaster dust drifted down from the ceiling. The prisms on the chandelier chimed gently as they shook. It rose, passing quickly through the mysterious pitch at 14 cycles per second, where the human spirit begins to feel distinctly uncomfortable about the universe and the place in it of the bowels. Small items around the opera house vibrated off shelves and smashed on the floor. The note climbed, rang like a bell, climbed again. In the pit, all the violin strings snapped, one by one. As the tone rose, the crystal prisms shook in the chandelier. In the bar, champagne corks fired a salvo. Ice jingled and shattered in its bucket. A line of wine glasses joined in the chorus, blurred around the rims, and then exploded like hazardous thistledown with attitude. There were harmonics and echoes that caused strange effects. In the dressing rooms, the number three grease paint melted. Mirrors cracked, filling the ballet school with a million fractured images. Dust rose, insects fell. In the stones of the opera house, tiny particles of quartz danced briefly. Then... There was silence, broken by the occasional thud and tinkle. Nanny grinned. Ah, she said, now the opera's over. Salzella opened his eyes. The stage was empty and dark and nevertheless brilliantly lit. That is, a huge shadowless light was streaming from some unseen source and yet apart from Salzella himself, there was nothing for it to illuminate. Footsteps sounded in the distance. Their owner took some time to arrive, but when he stepped into the liquid air around Salzella, he seemed to burst into flame. He wore red, a red suit with red lace, a red cloak, red shoes with ruby buckles, and a broad-rimmed red hat with a huge red feather. He even walked with a long red stick, bedecked with red ribbons. But for someone who had taken such meticulous trouble with his costume, he'd been remiss in the matter of his mask. It was a crude one of a skull, such as might be bought in any theatrical shop. Salzella could even see the string. 
Where did everyone go? Salzella demanded. Unpleasant recent memories were beginning to bubble up in his mind. He couldn't quite recall them clearly at the moment, but the taste of them was bad. The figure said nothing. Where's the orchestra? What happened to the audience? There was a barely perceptible shrug from the tall red figure. Salzella began to notice other details. What he had thought was the stage seemed slightly gritty underfoot. The ceiling above him was a long way away, perhaps as far away as anything could be, and was filled with cold, hard points of light. I asked you a question. Three questions, in fact. The words turned up on the inside of Salzella's ears with no suggestion that they had had to travel like normal sound. You didn't answer me. Some things you have to work out for yourself. And this is one of them, believe me. Who are you? You're not a member of the cast, I know that. Take off that mask. As you wish. I do like to get into the spirit of the thing. The figure removed its mask. And now take off that other mask, said Salzella, as the frozen fingers of dread rose through him. Death touched a secret spring on the stick. A blade shot out, so thin that it was transparent, its edge glittering blue as air molecules were sliced into their component atoms. Ah, he said, raising the scythe. There, I think you have me. It was dark in the cellars, but Nanny Og had walked alone in the strange caverns under Lancre and through the nighttime forests with Granny Weatherwax. Darkness held no fears for an og. She struck a match. Greeball? People had been tramping to and fro for hours. The darkness wasn't private anymore. It had taken quite a lot of people to carry all the money for a start. Up until the end of the opera, there had been something mysterious about all these cellars. Now they were just, well, damp underground rooms. Something that had lived here and moved on. Her foot rattled a piece of pottery. She grunted as she went down on one knee. Spilt mud and shards of broken pot littered the floor. Here and there, unrooted and snapped, were some unheeded pieces of dead twig. Only some kind of fool would have stuck bits of wood in pots of mud far underground and expected anything to happen. Nanny picked one up and sniffed it tentatively. It smelled of mud and nothing else. She'd have liked to have known how it had been done, just professional interest, of course, and she knew she never would now. Walter was a busy man now, up in the light. And for something to begin, other things had to end. We all wears a mask of one sort or another, she said to the damp air. No sense in upsetting things now, eh? The coach didn't leave until seven o'clock in the morning. By Lancre standards, that was practically midday. The witches got there early. I was hoping to shop for a few souvenirs, said Nanny, stamping her feet on the cobbles to keep warm. For the kiddies. No time, said Granny Weatherwax. Not that it would have made any difference on account of me not having any money to buy em with, Nanny went on. Not my fault if you fritter your money away, said Granny. I don't recall having a single chance to frit. Money's only useful for the things it can do. Well, yes, I could have done with having some new boots for a start. Nanny jiggled up and down a bit and whistled around her tooth. Nice of Mrs. Palm to let us stay there, gratis, she said. Yes. Of course, I helped out playing the piano and telling jokes. An added bonus, said Granny, nodding. And of course, there was all those little nibbles I prepared with the special party dip. Yes, indeed, said Granny, poker-faced. Mrs. Palm was saying only this morning that she's thinking of retiring next year. Nanny looked up and down the street again. I expect young Agnes will be turning up any minute now she said. I really couldn't say, said Granny haughtily. Not as though there's much for her here, after all. Granny sniffed. That's up to her, I'm sure. Everyone was very impressed, I reckoned, when you caught that sword in your hand. Granny sighed. Eh? Yes, I expect they were. They didn't think clearly, did they? People are just lazy. They never think maybe she had something in her hand, a bit of metal or something. They don't think for a minute it was just a trick. They don't think there's always a perfectly good explanation if you look for it. They probably think it was some kind of magic. Yeah, but you didn't have anything in your hand, did you? That's not the point. I might have done. Granny looked up and down the square. 
Besides, you can't magic iron. That's very true, not iron. Now, someone like old Black Alice, they could make their skin tougher than steel, but that's just an old legend, I expect. She could do it all right, said Granny, but you can't go round messing with cause and effect. That's what sent her mad come the finish. She thought she could put herself outside of things like cause and effect. Well, you can't. You grab a sharp sword by the blade, you get hurt. World would be a terrible place if people forgot that. You weren't hurt. Not my fault. I didn't have time. Nanny blew on her hands. One good thing, though, she said, it's a blessing the chandelier never came down. I was worried about that soon as I saw it. Looks too dramatic for its own good, I thought. First thing I'd smash if I was a loony. Yes. Haven't been able to find Grebo since last night. Good. He always turns up, though. Unfortunately. There was a clatter as the coach swung around the corner. It stopped. Then the coachman tugged on the reins, and it did a U-turn and disappeared again. Esme, said Nanny after a while. Yes? There's a man and two horses peering at us around the corner. She raised her voice. Come on, I know you're there. Seven o'clock this coach is supposed to leave. Did you get the ticket, says me? Me? Ah, said Nanny uncertainly. So, we haven't got eighty dollars for the tickets then? What have you got stuffed up your elastic, said Granny as the coach advanced cautiously. Nothing that is legal tender for travelling purposes, I fear. Then, no, we can't afford tickets. Nanny sighed. Oh well, I'll just have to use charm. It's going to be a long walk, said Granny. The coach pulled up. Nanny looked up at the driver and smiled innocently. Good morning, my good sir. He gave her a slightly frightened but mainly suspicious look. Is it? We are desirous of travelling to Lancre, but unfortunately we find ourselves a bit embarrassed in the knicker department. You are... But we are witches and could probably pay for our travel by, e.g., curing any embarrassing little ailments you may have. The coachman frowned. I ain't carrying you for nothing, old crone, and I haven't got any embarrassing little ailments. Granny stepped forward. How many would you like? she said. Rain rolled over the plains. It wasn't an impressive ram-tops thunderstorm, but a lazy, persistent, low cloud rain like a fat fog. It had been following them all day. The witches had the coach to themselves. Several people had opened the door while it had been waiting to leave, but for some reason had suddenly decided that today's travel plans didn't include a coach ride. Making good time, said Nanny, opening the curtains and peering out of the window. I expect the driver's in a hurry. Yes, I expect he is. Shut the window, though, it's getting wet in here. Right, y'all. Nanny grabbed the strap and then suddenly poked her head out into the rain. Stop, stop, tell the man to stop. The coach slewed to a halt in a sheet of mud. Nanny threw open the door. I don't know, try to walk home and in this weather too, you'll catch your death. Rain and fog rolled in through the open doorway. Then a bedraggled shape pulled itself over the sill and slunk under the seats, leaving small puddles behind it. Trying to be independent said Nanny. Bless him. The coach got underway again. Granny stared out at the endless darkening fields and the relentless drizzle, and saw another figure toiling along in the mud by the road that would eventually reach Lancre. As the coach swept past, it drenched the walker in thin slurry. Yes, indeed. Being independent's a fine ambition, she said, drawing the curtains. The trees were bare when Granny Weatherwax got back to her cottage. Twigs and seeds had blown in under the door. Soot had fallen down the chimney. Her home, always somewhat organic, had grown a little closer to its roots in the clay. There were things to do, so she did them. There were leaves to be swept, and the wood pile to be built up under the eaves. The wind sock behind the beehives, tattered by autumn storms, needed to be darned. Hay had to be got in for the goats. Apples had to be stored in the loft. The walls could do with another coat of whitewash, but there was something that had to be done first. It would make the other jobs a bit more difficult, but there was no help for that. You couldn't magic iron, and you couldn't grab a sword without being hurt. If that wasn't true, the world would be all over the place. Granny made herself some tea and then boiled up the kettle again. She took a handful of herbs out of a box on the dresser and dropped them in a bowl with the steaming water. She took a length of clean bandage out of a drawer and set it carefully on the table beside the bowl. 
She threaded an extremely sharp needle and laid needle and thread beside the bandage. She scooped a fingerful of greenish ointment out of a small tin and smeared it on a square of lint. That seemed to be it. She sat down and rested her arm on the table, palm up. Well, she said to no one in particular, I reckon I've got time now. The privy had to be moved. It was a job Granny preferred to do for herself. There was something incredibly satisfying in digging a very deep hole. It was uncomplicated. You knew where you were with a hole in the ground. Dirt didn't get strange ideas or believe that people were honest because they had a steady gaze and a firm handshake. It just lay there waiting for you to move it. And after you'd done it, you could sit there in the lovely warm knowledge that it'd be months before you had to do it again. It was while she was at the bottom of the hole that a shadow fell across it. Afternoon, Perdita, she said without looking up. She lifted another shovelful to head height and flung it over the edge. Come home for a visit, have you? she said. She rammed the shovel into the clay at the bottom of the hole again, winced and forced it down with her foot. Thought you were doing very well in the opera, she went on. Cause I'm not an expert in these things. Good to see young people seeking their fortune in the big city, though. She looked up with a bright, friendly smile. I see you've lost a bit of weight, too. Innocence hung from her words like loops of toffee. I've been taking exercise, said Agnes. Exercise is a fine thing, certainly, said Granny, getting back to her digging. Though they do say you can have too much of it. When are you going back? Or... Uh, haven't decided. Well, it doesn't pay to be always planning. Don't tie yourself down the whole time. I've always said that. Staying with your ma, are you? Yes, said Agnes. Ah, oh, only Magrat's old cottage is still empty. You'd be doing everyone a favour if you aired it out a bit, you know, uh, as long as you're here. Agnes said nothing. She couldn't think of anything to say. Funny old thing, said Granny, hacking around a particularly troublesome tree root. I wouldn't tell everyone, but I was only thinking the other day about when I was younger and called myself Endomonedia. You did? When? Granny rubbed her forehead with her bandaged hand, leaving a clay-red smudge. Oh, for about three or four hours, she said. Some names don't have the staying power. Never pick yourself a name you can't scrub the floor in. She threw her shovel out of the hole. Give me a hand up, will you? Agnes did so. Granny brushed the dirt and leaf mould off her apron and tried to stamp the clay off her boots. Time for a cup of tea, eh? She said. Ma, you are looking well. It's the fresh air. Too much stuffy air in that opera house, I thought. Agnes tried in vain to detect anything in Granny Weatherwax's eyes other than transparent honesty and goodwill. Yes, I thought so too, she said. Er... Uh, you hurt your hand? It'll heal. A lot of things do. She shouldered her shovel and headed towards the cottage, and then halfway up the path turned and looked back. This is just me asking, you understand, in a kind of neighbourly way, taking an interest sort of thing. Wouldn't be human if I didn't. Agnes sighed. Yes. You got much to do with your evenings these days? There was just enough rebellion left in Agnes to put a sarcastic edge on her voice. Oh, are you offering to teach me something? Teach? No, said Granny. I ain't got the patience for teaching. But I might let you learn. When shall we three meet again? We haven't met once yet. Of course we have. I've personally known you for at least... I mean, we three haven't met. You know... Officially. All right. When shall we three meet? We're already here. All right. When shall? Just shut up and get out the marshmallows. Agnes, give Nanny the marshmallows. Yes, Granny. And mind you don't burn mine. Granny sat back. It was a clear night, although clouds mounting towards the hub promised snow soon. A few sparks flew up towards the stars. She looked around proudly. Isn't this nice, she said. <laughs> that 
is The End of Masquerade. It was written by Terry Pratchett and read by Nigel Plainer. This has been an ISIS audiobooks production. Please write or phone on 01865 250 3 for details of our extensive range of unabridged audiobooks.
Isis Audiobooks presents an unabridged recording of Feet of Clay, written by Terry Pratchett, read by Nigel Planer. It was a warm spring night when a fist knocked at the door so hard that the hinges bent. A man opened it and peered out into the street. There was mist coming off the river, and it was a cloudy night. He might as well have tried to see through white velvet. But he thought afterwards that there had been shapes out there just beyond the lights spilling out into the road. A lot of shapes, watching him carefully. He thought maybe there'd been very faint points of light. There was no mistaking the shape right in front of him, though. It was big and dark red, and looked like a child's clay model of a man. Its eyes were two embers. Well, what do you want at this time of night? The golem handed him a slate, on which was written, We hear you want a golem. Of course, golems couldn't speak, could they? Ha! Ah! Want? Yes. Afford? No. I've been asking around, but it's wicked the prices you're going for these days. The golem rubbed the words off the slate and wrote, To you, one hundred dollars. You're for sale? No. The golem lurched aside. Another one stepped into the light. It was also a golem. The man could see that. But it wasn't like the usual lump and clay things that you occasionally saw. This one gleamed like a newly polished statue, perfect down to the detailing of the clothes. It reminded him of one of the old pictures of the city's kings, all haughty stance and imperious haircut. In fact, it even had a small coronet moulded onto its head. A hundred dollars? said the man suspiciously. What's wrong with it? Who's selling it? Nothing is wrong. Perfect in all detail. Ninety dollars. Sounds like someone wants to get rid of it in a hurry. Golem must work. Golem must have a master. Yeah, right, but you hear stories going mad and making too many things and that? Not mad. Eighty dollars. It looks new, said the man, tapping the gleaming chest. But no one's making golems any more. That's what's keeping the price up beyond the purse of the small business. He stopped. Is someone making them again? Eighty dollars. I heard the priest spanned making them years ago. A man could get in a lot of trouble. Seventy dollars. Who's doing it? Six. Sixty dollars. Is he selling them to Albertson? Or Spadger and Williams? It's hard enough competing as it is that they've got the money to invest in new plant. Fifty dollars. The man walked around the golem. A man can't sit by and watch his company collapse under him because of unfair price cutting, I mean to say. Forty dollars. Religion is all very well, but what do profits know about profits, hmm? Hmm. He looked up at the shapeless golem in the shadows. Was that, uh, thirty dollars I just saw you write? Yes. I've always liked dealing wholesale. Wait one moment. He went back inside and returned with a handful of coins. Will you be selling any to them other bastards? No. Good. Tell your boss it's a pleasure to do business with him. Get along inside, Sonny Jim. The white golem walked into the factory. The man, glancing from side to side, trotted in after it and shut the door. Deeper shadows moved in the dark. There was a faint hissing, then, rocking slightly, the big heavy shapes moved away. Shortly afterwards, and around the corner, a beggar holding out a hopeful hand for arms was amazed to find himself suddenly richer by a whole thirty dollars. He subsequently got dead drunk and was shanghaied aboard a merchantman bound for strange and foreign parts, 
where he met lots of young ladies who didn't wear many clothes. He eventually died from stepping on a tiger. A good deed goes around the world. The disc world turned against the glittering backdrop of space, spinning very gently on the backs of the four giant elephants that perched on the shell of Great Artuin, the Star Turtle. Continents drifted slowly past, topped by weather systems that themselves turned gently against the flow, like waltzers spinning counter to the whirl of the dance. A billion tons of geography rolled slowly through the sky. People look down on stuff like geography and meteorology, and not only because they're standing on one and being soaked by the other. They don't look quite like real science. That is to say, the sort you can use to give something three extra legs and then blow it up. But geography is only physics slowed down and with a few trees stuck on it, and meteorology is full of excitingly fashionable chaos and complexity. And summer isn't a time. It's a place as well. Summer is a moving creature and likes to go south for the winter. Even on the disc world, with its tiny orbiting sun tilting over the turning world, the seasons moved. In Ankh-Morpork, greatest of its cities, spring was nudged aside by summer, and summer was prodded in the back by autumn. Geographically speaking, there was not a lot of difference within the city itself, although in late spring the scum on the river was often a nice emerald green. The mist of spring became the fog of autumn, which mixed with fumes and smoke from the magical quarter and the workshops of the alchemists, until it seemed to have a thick, choking life of its own, and time moved on. Autumn fog pressed itself against the midnight window panes. Blood ran in a trickle across the pages of a rare volume of religious essays which had been torn in half. There had been no need for that, thought Father Tubalcheck. A further thought suggested that there had been no need to hit him either, but Father Tubalcheck had never been very concerned about that sort of thing. People healed, books didn't. He reached out shakily and tried to gather up the pages, but slumped back again. The room was spinning. The door swung open. Heavy footsteps creaked across the floor. One footstep, at least, and one dragging noise. Step, drag, step, drag. Father Tubalcheck tried to focus. You, he croaked, nod. Pick up the books. The old priest watched as the books were retrieved and piled carefully with fingers not well suited to the task. The newcomer took a quill pen from the debris, carefully wrote something on a scrap of paper, then rolled it up and placed it delicately between Father Tubalcheck's lips. The dying priest tried to smile. We don't work like that, he mumbled, the little cylinder wobbling like a last cigarette. We make our own... The kneeling figure watched him for a while, and then, taking great care, leaned forward slowly and closed his eyes. Commander Sir Samuel Vimes, Ankh Morpork City Guard, frowned at himself in the mirror and began to shave. The razor was a sword of freedom. Shaving was an act of rebellion. These days, someone ran his bath every day. You wouldn't think the human skin could stand it. And someone laid out his clothes, such clothes, and someone cooked his meals, what meals he was putting on weight, he knew. And someone even polished his boots, and such boots, no cardboard sold wrecks, but big, well-fitting boots of genuine shiny leather. There was someone to do nearly everything for him, but there were some things a man ought to do for himself, and one of them was shaving. He knew that Lady Sybil mildly disapproved. Her father had never shaved himself in his life. He had a man for it. Vimes had protested that he'd spent too many years trudging the nighttime streets to be happy about anyone else wielding a blade anywhere near his neck. But the real reason, the unspoken reason, was that he hated the very idea of the world being divided into the shaved and the shavers, or those who wore the shiny boots and those who cleaned the mud off them. Every time he saw Willikins, the butler, fold his, Vimes's clothes, he suppressed a terrible urge to kick the butler's shiny backside as an affront to the dignity of man. The razor moved calmly over the stubble of the night. Yesterday there had been some official dinner. He couldn't recall now what it had been for. He seemed to spend his whole life at the things. 
arch, giggling women and braying young men who'd been at the back of the line when the chins were handed out. And as usual, he'd come back through the fog-bound city in a filthy temper with himself. He'd noticed a light under the kitchen door and heard conversation and laughter and had gone in. Willikins was there with the old man who stoked the boiler and the head gardener and the boy who cleaned the spoons and lit the fires. They were playing cards. There were bottles of beer on the table. He pulled up a chair and cracked a few jokes and asked to be dealt in. They'd been welcoming, in a way, but as the game progressed, Vimes had been aware of the universe crystallizing around him. It was like becoming a cogwheel in a glass clock. There was no laughter. They called him Sir and kept clearing their throats. Everything was very careful. Finally, he'd mumbled an excuse and stumbled out. Halfway along the passage, he thought he heard a comment, followed by, well, maybe it was only a chuckle, but it might have been a snigger. The razor carefully circumnavigated the nose. Huh. A couple of years ago, a man like Willikins would have allowed him into the kitchen only on sufferance, and would have made him take his boots off. So that's your life now, Commander Sir Samuel Vimes. A jumped-up copper to the knobs and a knob to the rest, hmm? He frowned at the reflection in the mirror. He'd started out in the gutter, true enough. And now he was on three meat meals a day, good boots, a warm bed at night, and come to that, a wife too, good old Sybil. Although she did tend to talk about curtains these days, but Sergeant Colon had said this happened to wives and was a biological thing and perfectly normal. He'd actually been rather attached to his old cheap boots. He could read the street in them, the soles were so thin. It had got so that he could tell where he was on a pitch-dark night, just by the feel of the cobbles. Ah, oh, well. There was something mildly strange about Sam Vimes's shaving mirror. It was slightly convex, so that it reflected more of the room than a flat mirror would do, and it gave a very good view of the outbuildings and gardens beyond the window. Hmm. Going thin on top. Definitely a receding scalp there. Less hair to comb, but on the other hand, more face to wash. There was a flicker in the glass. He moved sideways and ducked. The mirror smashed. There was the sound of feet somewhere beyond the broken window, and then a crash and a scream. Vimes straightened up. He fished the largest piece of mirror out of the shaving bowl and propped it up on the black crossbow bolt that had buried itself in the wall. He finished shaving. Then he rang the bell for the butler. Willikins materialized. Sir? Vimes rinsed the razor. Get the boy to nip along to the glazier, will you? The butler's eyes flickered to the window and then to the shattered mirror. Yes, sir. And the bill to go to the Assassin's Guild again, sir? With my compliments. And while he's out, he's to call in at that shop in five and seven yard and get me another shaving mirror. The dwarf there knows the kind I like. Yes, sir, and I shall fetch a dustpan and brush directly, sir. Shall I inform her ladyship of this eventuality, sir? No, she always says it's my fault for encouraging them. Very good, sir, said Willikins. He dematerialized. Sam Vimes dried himself off and went downstairs to the morning room, where he opened the cabinet and took out the new crossbow Sybil had given him as a wedding present. Sam Vimes was used to the old guard crossbows, which had a nasty habit of firing backwards in a tight corner, but this was a burly and strong-in-the-arm, made-to-measure job, with the oiled walnut stock. There was none finer, it was said. Then he selected a thin cigar and strolled out into the garden. There was a commotion coming from the dragon house. Vimes entered and shut the door behind him. He rested the crossbow against the door. The yammering and squeaking increased. Little gouts of flame puffed above the thick walls of the hatching pens. Vimes leaned over the nearest one. He picked up a newly hatched dragonette and tickled it under the chin. As it flamed excitedly, he lit his cigar and savoured the smoke. He blew a smoke ring at the figure hanging from the ceiling. Good morning, he said. The figure twisted frantically. By an amazing feat of muscle control, it had managed to catch a foot around a beam as it fell, but it couldn't quite pull itself up. 
dropping was not to be thought of. A dozen baby dragons were underneath it, jumping up and down excitedly and flaming. Eh, uh, good morning, said the hanging figure. Turned out nice again, said Vimes, picking up a bucket of coal. Although the fog will be back later, I expect. He took a small nugget and tossed it to the dragons. They squabbled for it. Vimes gripped another lump. The young dragon that had caught the coal already had a distinctly longer and hotter flame. I suppose, said the young man, that I could not prevail upon you to let me down. Another dragon caught some coal and belched a fireball. The young man swung desperately to avoid it. Yes, said Vimes. I suspect, uh, on reflection, that it was foolish of me to choose the roof, said the assassin. Probably, said Vimes. He'd spent several hours a few weeks ago sawing through joists and carefully balancing the roof tiles. I should have dropped off the wall and used the shrubbery. Possibly, said Vimes. He'd set a bear trap in the shrubbery. He took some more coal. I suppose you wouldn't tell me who hired you. I'm afraid not, sir. You know the rules. Vimes nodded gravely. We had Lady Salachi sat up before the patrician last week, said Vimes. Now there's a lad who needs to learn that no doesn't mean yes, please. Could be, sir. And then there was that business with Lord Rust's boy. You can't shoot servants for putting your shoes the wrong way round, you know. It's too messy. He'll have to learn right from left like the rest of us, and right from wrong, too. I hear what you say, sir. We seem to have reached an impasse, said Vimes. It seems so, sir. Vimes aimed a lump at a small bronze and green dragon, which caught it expertly. The heat was getting intense. What I don't understand, he said, is why you fellows mainly try it here or at the office. I mean, I walk around a lot, don't I? You could shoot me down in the street, couldn't you? What? Like some common murderer, sir? Vimes nodded. It was black and twisted, but the Assassin's Guild had an honour of a sort. How much was I worth? Twenty thousand, sir. Hm, should be higher, said Vimes. I agree. If the Assassin got back to the Guild, it would be, Vimes thought. Assassins valued their own lives quite highly. Let me see now, said Vimes, examining the end of his cigar. Guild takes fifty percent, that leaves ten thousand dollars. The assassin seemed to consider this, and then reached up to his belt and tossed a bag rather clumsily towards Vimes, who caught it. Vimes picked up his crossbow. It seems to me, he said, that if a man were to be let go, he might well make it to the door with no more than superficial burns if he were fast. How fast are you? There was no answer. Of course, he'd have to be desperate, said Vimes, wedging the crossbow on the feed table and taking a piece of cord out of his pocket. He lashed the cord to a nail and fastened the other end to the crossbow's string. Then, standing carefully to one side, he eased the trigger. The string moved very slightly. The assassin, watching him upside down, seemed to have stopped breathing. Vimes puffed at his cigar until the end was an inferno. Then he took it out of his mouth and leaned it against the restraining cord so that it would have just a fraction of an inch to burn before the string began to smoulder. I'll leave the door unlocked, he said. I've never been an unreasonable man. I shall watch your career with interest. He tossed the rest of the coals to the dragons and stepped outside. It looked like being another eventful day in Ankh-Morpork, pork and it had only just begun. As Vimes reached the house, he heard a whoosh, a click, and the sound of someone running very fast towards the ornamental lake. He smiled. Willikins was waiting with his coat. Remember you have an appointment with his lordship at eleven, Sir Samuel? Yes, yes, said Vimes. And you are to go and see the Hevels at ten? Her ladyship was very explicit, sir. Her exact words were, Tell him he is not to try to wriggle out of it again, sir. Oh, very well. And her ladyship said, Please try not to upset anyone. Tell her I'll try. And your sedan chair is outside, sir. Vimes sighed. Thank you. There's a man in the ornamental lake. Fish him out and give him a cup of tea, will you? Promising lad, I thought.
Certainly, sir. The chair. Oh, yes, the chair. It had been a wedding present from the patrician. Lord Vetinari knew that Vimes loved walking the streets of the city, and so it was very typical of the man that he presented him with something that did not allow him to do so. It was waiting outside. The two bearers straightened up expectantly. Sir Samuel Vimes, commander of the city watch, rebelled again. Perhaps he did have to use the damn thing, but... He looked at the front man and motioned with a thumb to the chair's door. Get in, he commanded. Good sir, it's a nice morning, said Vimes, taking off his coat again. I'll drive meself. Dearest Mum and Dad Captain Carrot of the Ankh-Morpork Pork City Watch was on his day off. He had a routine. First he had breakfast in some handy café, then he wrote his letter home. Letters home always gave him some trouble. Letters from his parents were always interesting, being full of mining statistics and exciting news about new shafts and promising seams. All he had to write about were murders and such things as that. He chewed the end of his pencil for a moment. Well, it has been an interesting week again, he wrote. I am running around like a fly with a blue bottom and no mistake. We are opening another watch house at Chitling Street, which is handy for the shades, so now we have no less than four, including Dolly Sisters and Longwall, and I am the only captain, so I am around at all hours. Personally, I sometimes miffs the camaraderie of the old days when it was just me and Nobby and Sergeant Colon, but this is the century of the fruit bat. Sergeant Colon is going to retire at the end of the month. He says Mrs. Colon wants him to buy a farm. He says he is looking forward to the peace of the country and being close to nature. I'm sure you would wish him well. My friend Nobby is still Nobby, only more than he was. Carrot absent-mindedly took a half-eaten mutton chop from his breakfast plate and held it out below the table. It was an unk. Anyway, back to the job. Also, I am sure I have told you about the Cable Street particulars, although they are still based in Pseudopolis Yard. People do not like it when watchmen do not wear uniforms, but Commander Vimes says criminals don't wear uniforms either, so be damned to the lot of them. Carrot paused. It said a lot about Captain Carrot that even after almost two years in Ankh Morpork, he was still uneasy about damned. Commander Vimes says you have to have secret policemen because there are secret crimes. Carrot paused again. He loved his uniform. He didn't have any other clothes. The idea of watchmen in disguise was, well, it was unthinkable. It was like those pirates who sailed under false colours. It was like spies. However, he went on dutifully, and Commander Vimes knows what he is talking about, I am sure. He says it's not like old-fashioned police work, which was catching the poor devils too stupid to run away. Anyhow, it all means a lot more work and new faces in the watch. While he waited for a new sentence to form, Carrot took a sausage from his plate and lowered it. There was another oink. The waiter bustled up. Another helping, Mr. Carrot, on the house? Every restaurant and eatery in Ankh Morpork offered free food to Carrot, in the certain and happy knowledge that he would always insist on paying. No, indeed, that was very good. Here we are, twenty pence and keep the change, said Carrot. How's your young lady? Haven't seen her today? Angua? Oh, she's around and about, you know. I shall definitely tell her you asked after her, though. The dwarf nodded happily and bustled off. Carrot wrote another few dutiful lines, and then said very softly, Is that horse and cart still outside Iron Crust's bakery? There was a whine from under the table. Really? That's odd. All the deliveries were over hours ago, and the flour and grit doesn't usually arrive until the afternoon. Driver still sitting there? Something barked quietly. And that looks quite a good horse for a delivery cart. And you know, normally you'd expect the driver to put a nose bag on. And it's the last Thursday in the month, which is payday at Iron Crusts.
Carrot laid down his pencil and waved a hand politely to catch the waiter's eye. Cup of acorn coffee, Mr. Gimlet, to take away? In the Dwarf Bread Museum, in Whirligig Alley, Mr. Hopkinson, the curator, was somewhat excited. Apart from other considerations, he'd just been murdered. But at the moment he was choosing to consider this as an annoying background detail. He'd been beaten to death with a loaf of bread. This is unlikely even in the worst of human bakeries, but dwarf bread has amazing properties as a weapon of offence. Dwarfs regard baking as part of the art of warfare. When they make rock cakes, no simile is intended. Look at this dent here, said Hopkinson. It's quite ruined the crust. And your skull, too, said Death. Oh, yes, said Hopkinson, in the voice of one who regards skulls as ten a penny, but is well aware of the rarity value of a good bread exhibit. But what was wrong with a simple cosh, or even a hammer? I could have provided one if asked. Death, who was by nature an obsessive personality himself, realized that he was in the presence of a master. The late Mr. Hopkinson had a squeaky voice and wore spectacles on a length of black tape. His ghost now wore their spiritual counterpart, and these were always the signs of a mind that polished the undersides of furniture and stored paper clips by size. It really is too bad, said Mr. Hopkinson, and ungrateful too, after the help I gave them with the oven. I really feel I shall have to complain. Mr. Hopkinson, are you fully aware that you are dead? Dead? trilled the curator. Oh, no, I can't possibly be dead. Not at the moment. It's simply not convenient. I haven't even catalogued the combat muffins. Nevertheless, no, no, I'm sorry, but it just won't do. You will have to wait. I really cannot be bothered with that sort of nonsense. Death was nonplussed. Most people were after the initial confusion somewhat relieved when they died. A subconscious weight had been removed. The other cosmic shoe had dropped. The worst had happened, and they could metaphorically get on with their lives. Few people treated it as a simple annoyance that might go away if you complained enough. Mr. Hopkinson's hand went through a tabletop. Oh! You see, this is most uncalled for. Couldn't you have arranged a less awkward time? Only by consultation with your murderer... It all seems very badly organized. I wish to make a complaint. I pay my taxes after all. I am deaf, not taxes. I turn up only once. The shade of Mr. Hopkinson began to fade. It's simply that I've always tried to plan ahead in a sensible way. I, I find the best approach is to take life as it comes. That seems very irresponsible. It's always worked for me. The sedan chair came to a halt outside Pseudopolis Yard. Vimes left the runners to park it and strode in, putting his coat back on. There had been a time, and it seemed like only yesterday, when the watch house had been almost empty. There'd be old Sergeant Colon dozing in his chair, and Corporal Nobbs's washing drying in front of the stove, and then suddenly it had all changed. Sergeant Colon was waiting for him with a clipboard. Got the report from the other watch houses, sir, he said, trotting along beside Vimes. Anything special? Been a bit of an odd murder, sir, down in one of them old houses on Misbegot Bridge. Some old priest, don't know much about it. The patrol just said it ought to be looked at. Who found him? Constable visit, sir. Oh, gods. Yes, sir. I'll try to get along there this morning. Anything else? Corporal Nobbs is sick, sir. Oh, I doubt that. I mean, off sick, sir? Not his granny's funeral this time? No, sir. How many has he had this year, by the way? Seven, sir. Very odd family, the Nubbses. Yes, sir. Fred, you don't have to keep calling me, sir. Got company, sir? said the sergeant, glancing meaningfully towards a bench in the main office. Come for that alchemy job? A dwarf smiled nervously at Vimes. All right, said Vimes. I'll see him in my office. He reached into his coat and took out the assassin's money pouch. Put it in the widows and orphans fund, will you, Fred? Right. 
Oh, well done, sir. Any more windfalls like this, I must soon be able to afford some more widows. Sergeant Colon went back to his desk, surreptitiously opened his drawer and pulled out the book he was reading. It was called Animal Husbandry. He'd been a bit worried about the title. You heard stories about strange folk in the country, but it turned out to be nothing more than a book about how cattle and pigs and sheep should breed. Now he was wondering where to get a book that taught them how to read. Upstairs, Vimes pushed open his office door carefully. The Assassin's Guild played to rules, you could say that about the bastards. It was terribly bad form to kill a bystander. Apart from anything else, you wouldn't get paid. So traps in his office were out of the question, because too many people were in and out of it every day. Even so, it paid to be careful. Vimes was good at making the kind of rich enemies who could afford to employ assassins. The assassins had to be lucky only once. But Vimes had to be lucky all the time. He slipped into the room and glanced out of the window. He liked to work with it open, even in cold weather. He liked to hear the sounds of the city. But anyone trying to climb up or down to it would run into everything in the way of loose tiles, shifting handholds, and treacherous drain pipes that Vimes's ingenuity could contrive. And Vimes had installed spiked railings down below. They were nice and ornamental, but they were, above all, spiky. So far, Vimes was winning. There was a tentative knock at the door. It had issued from the knuckles of the dwarf applicant. Vimes ushered him into the office, shut the door, and sat down at his desk. So, he said, you're an alchemist. Acid stains on your hands and no eyebrows. That's right, sir. Not usual to find a dwarf in that line of work. You people always seem to toil in your uncle's foundry or something. You people, the dwarf noted. Can't get the hang of metal, he said. A dwarf who can't get the hang of metal? That must be unique. Pretty rare, sir, but I was quite good at alchemy. Guild member? Not any more, sir. Oh, how did you leave the guild? Through the roof, sir, but I'm pretty certain I know what I did wrong. Vimes leaned back. The alchemists are always blowing things up. I'd never heard of them getting sacked for it. That's because no one's ever blown up the guild council, sir. What? All of it? Most of it, sir. All the easily detachable bits, at least. Vimes found he was automatically opening the bottom drawer of his desk. He pushed it shut again and instead shuffled the papers in front of him. What's your name, lad? The dwarf swallowed. This was clearly the bit he'd been dreading. Mm -hmm. uh, Little Bottom, sir. Vimes didn't even look up. Ah, yes, it says here. That means you're from the Uberwald Mountain area, yes? Why, yes, sir, said Little Bottom, mildly surprised. Humans generally couldn't distinguish between dwarf clans. Our constable Angua comes from there, said Vimes. Now, it says here your first name is... Uh, can't read Fred's handwriting. Uh, there was nothing for it. <laughs> Cheery, sir, said Cheery Little Bottom. Cheery, eh? Good to see the old naming traditions kept up. Cheery Little Bottom, fine. Little Bottom watched carefully. Not the faintest glimmer of amusement had crossed Vimes's face. Yes, sir. Cheery Little Bottom, he said. And there still wasn't as much as an extra wrinkle there. My father was jolly, jolly Little Bottom, he added, as one might prod at a bad tooth to see when the pain will come. Really? Hmm. And his father was Beaky Little Bottom. Not a trace, not a smidgen of a grin twitched anywhere. Vimes merely pushed the paper aside. Well, we work for a living here, Little Bottom. Yes, sir. We don't blow things up, Little Bottom. No, sir, I don't blow everything up, sir. Some just melts. Vimes drummed his fingers on the desk. Know anything about dead bodies? Mm, they were only mildly concussed, sir. Vimes sighed. Listen. I know about how to be a copper. It's mainly walking and talking. But there's lots of things I don't know. You find the scene of a crime and there's some grey powder on the floor. What is it? I don't know. But you fellows know how to mix things up in bowls and can find out. And maybe the dead person doesn't seem to have a mark on them. Were they poisoned? It seems we need someone who knows what colour a liver is supposed to be. 
I want someone who can look at the ashtray and tell me what kind of cigars I smoke. Pentweeds, slim panatellas, said Littlebottom automatically. Good gods. You've left a packet on the table, sir. Vimes looked down. All right, he said. So sometimes it's an easy answer, but sometimes it isn't. Sometimes we don't even know if it was the right question. He stood up. I can't say I like dwarfs much, little bottom, but I don't like trolls or humans either, so I suppose that's okay. Well, you're the only applicant. Thirty dollars a month, five dollars living out allowance. I expect you to work for the job, not to the clock, and the some mythical creature called overtime. Only no one's ever seen its footprints. If troll officers call you a grit sucker, they're out, and if you call them rocks, you're out. We're just one big family, and when you've been to a few domestic disputes, little bottom, I can assure you that you'll see the resemblance. We work as a team, and we're pretty much making it up as we go along, and half the time we're not even certain what the law is, so it can get interesting. Technically, you'll rank as a corporal, only don't go giving orders to real policemen. You're on a month's trial, we'll give you some training just as soon as there's time. Now, find an iconograph and meet me on Miss Begot Bridge in... Oh, damn. Better make it an hour. I've got to see about this blasted coat of arms. Ugh. Still, dead bodies seldom get dinner. Sergeant Detritus? There was a series of creaks as something heavy moved along the corridor outside and a troll opened the door. Yes, sir? This is Corporal Littlebottom, Corporal Cheery Littlebottom, whose father was Jolly Littlebottom. Give him his badge, swear him in, show him where everything is. Very good, Corporal. I shall try to be a credit to the uniform, sir, said Littlebottom. Good, said Vimes briskly. He looked at Detritus. Incidentally, Sergeant, I've got a report here that a troll in uniform nailed one of Chrysoprase's henchmen to a wall by his ears last night. Know anything about that? The troll wrinkled its enormous forehead. Does it say anything about him selling bags of slab to troll kids? No. It says he was going to read spiritual literature to his dear old mother, said Vimes. Did Hardcore say he saw this troll's badge? No, but he says the troll threatened to ram it where the sun doesn't shine, said Vimes. Detritus nodded gravely. That's a long way to go just to ruin a good badge, he said. By the way, said Vimes, that was a lucky guess of yours, guessing it was hardcore. It came to me in a flash, sir, said Detritus. I thought, what bastard who sells slab to kids deserves being nailed up by his ears, sir, and bingo, this idea just formed in my head. That's what I thought. Cheery little bottom looked from one impassive face to the other. The watchman's eyes never left each other's faces, but the words seemed to come from a little distance, as though both of them were reading an invisible script. Then Detritus shook his head slowly. Must have been an imposter, sir. It's easy to get helmets like ours. None of my trolls do anything like that. That would be police brutality, sir. Glad to hear it. Just for the look of the thing, though, I want you to check the troll's lockers. The Silicon Anti-Defamation League are onto this one. Yes, sir, and if I find out it was one of my trolls, I will be down on that troll, like a ton of rectangular building things, sir. Fine. Well, off you go, Little Bottom. Detritus will look after you. Little Bottom hesitated. This was uncanny. The man hadn't mentioned axes or gold. He hadn't even said anything like, you can make it big in the watch. Littlebottom felt really unbalanced. Uh, I did tell you my name, didn't I, sir? Yes, got it down here, said Vimes. Cheery Little Bottom, yes? Uh, yes, that's right. Well, uh, thank you, sir. Vimes listened to them go down the passage. Then he carefully shut the door and put his coat over his head so that no one would hear him laughing. <laughs> Cheery little bottom. <laughs> Cheery ran after the troll called Detritus. The watch house was beginning to fill up, and it was clear that the watch dealt with all sorts of things, and that many of them involved shouting. Two uniformed trolls were standing in front of Sergeant Colon's high desk, with a slightly smaller troll between them. This troll was wearing a downcast expression. It was also wearing a tutu, and had a small pair of gauze wings glued to its back. Happen to know that trolls don't have any tradition of a tooth fairy, 
Colin was saying, especially not one called, he looked down, Tinker Bell. So how about if we just call it breaking and entering without a thieves' guild license? It's racial prejudice, not letting trolls have a tooth fairy, Tinkerbell muttered. One of the troll guards upended a sack on the desk. Various items of silverware cascaded over the paperwork. And this is what you found under their pillows, was it? said Colon. Bless their little hearts, said Clinkerbell. At the next desk a tired dwarf was arguing with a vampire. Look, he said, it's not murder. You're dead already, right? He stuck them right in me. Well, I've been down to interview the manager, and he said it was an accident. He said he's got nothing against vampires at all. He said he was merely carrying three boxes of HB eraser tips and tripped over the edge of your cloak. I don't see why I can't work where I like. Yes, but huh, in a pencil factory? Detritus looked down at Littlebottom and grinned. Welcome to life in the big city, Littlebottom, he said. That's an interesting name. Uh, is it? Most dwarves have names like Rock Heaver or Strong in the Arm. Oh, do they? Detritus was not one for the fine detail of relationships, but the edge in Littlebottom's voice got through to him. Uh, it's a good name, though, he said. Uh, what's Slab? said Cherry. It's your chloric ammonium and radium mixed up. It give your head a tingle, but melts troll brains. Big problem in the mountains. And some buggers are making it here in the city, and we're trying to find out how it gets up there. Mr. Vimes is letting me run a, a, a detritus concentrated, a public awareness campaign telling people what happens to buggers who sells it to kids. He waved a hand at a large and rather crudely done poster on the wall. It said, Slab, just say, Please, no! Rah! He pushed open a door. This is the old privy what we don't use no more. You can use it for mixing up stuff. It's the only place we got now. You have to clean it up first because it smells like a toilet in here. He opened another door. And this is the locker room, he said. You got your own peg and that, and there's these panels for getting changed behind because we knows you dwarfs is modest. The good life if you don't weaken. Mr. Vimes is okay, but he's a bit weird about some stuff. He keeping on saying stuff like, this city is a melting pot, and all the scum floats to the top, hmm? and stuff like that. I'll give you your helmet and badge in a minute, but first... He opened a rather larger locker on the other side of the room, which had detritus painted on it. I've got to go and hide this hammer. Two figures hurried out of Iron Crust's dwarf bakery, to bread with to edge, threw themselves onto the cart and shouted at the driver to leave urgently. He turned a pale face towards them and pointed to the road ahead. There was a wolf there. Not a usual kind of wolf. It had a blonde coat, which around its ears was almost long enough to be a mane, and wolves did not normally sit calmly on their haunches in the middle of a street. This one was growling, a long, low growl. It was the audible equivalent of a shortening fuse. The horse was transfixed, too frightened to stay where it was, but far too terrified to move. One of the men carefully reached for a crossbow. The growl rose slightly. He even more carefully took his hand away. The growl subsided again. What is it? It's a wolf. In a city? What does it find to eat? Oh, why did you have to ask that? Good morning, gentlemen, said Carrot, as he stopped leaning against the wall. Looks like the fog's rising again. Thieves' Guild's licenses, please. They turned. Carrot gave them a happy smile and nodded encouragingly. One of the men patted his coat in a theatrical display of absent-mindedness. Oh, ah, oh, uh, well, uh, ooh, uh, left the house in a bit of a hurry this morning. Uh, must have forgotten. Section 2, Rule 1 of the Thieves' Guild Charter says that members must carry their cards on all professional occasions, said Carrot. 
He's not even drawn his sword, hissed the most stupid of the three strong gang. He doesn't need to. He's got a loaded wolf. Someone was writing in the gloom, the scritching of their pen the only sound, until a door creaked open. The writer turned quick as a bird. You! I told you never to come back here! I know, I know, but <laughs> it's that damn thing! The production line stopped and it's got out and it's killed the priest! Did anyone see it? In the fog we had last night? I shouldn't think so, but then it is not. <laughs> A matter of significance. No, they're not supposed to kill people. Well, that is, the speaker conceded, not by smashing them on the head, anyway. They will, if so, instructed. I never told it to. Anyway, what if it turns on me? On its master? It can't disobey the words in its head, man. The visitor sat down, shaking his head. Yeah, but 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 which words? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. This is getting too much. That damn thing around all the time. Making you a fat profit. All right, all right. But this other stuff, the poison, I never... Shut up. I'll see you again tonight. You can tell the others that I certainly do have a candidate. And if you dare come here again... The Ankh Morpork Royal College of Heralds turned out to be a green gate in a wall in Mollybog Street. Vimes tugged on the belt pull. Something clanged on the other side of the wall, and immediately the place erupted in a cacophony of hoots, growls, whistles, and trumpetings. A voice shouted, Down, boy, Couchon! I said, er, uh, Couchon! No, not Rempon! And thee shall have a sugar lump like a good boy! William, stop that at once! Put him down! Mildred, let go of Graham! The animal noises subsided a bit, and footsteps approached. A wicket gate in the main door opened a fraction. Vimes saw an inch-wide segment of a very short man. Yes? Are you the meat man? Kabada Vimes, said Vimes. I have an appointment. The animal noises started up again. Eh? Kamada Vimes, Vimes shouted. Oh, I suppose thee'd better come in. The door swung open. Vimes stepped through. Silence fell. Several dozen pairs of eyes regarded Vimes with acute suspicion. Some of the eyes were small and red. Several were big and poked just above the surface of the scummy pond that occupied a lot of space in the yard. Some were on perches. The yard was full of animals. But even they were crowded out by the smell of a yard full of animals. And most of them were clearly very old, which didn't do anything for the smell. A toothless lion yawned at Vimes. A lion running, or at least lounging around loose, was amazing in itself, but not so amazing as the fact that it was being used as a cushion by an elderly griffon, which was asleep with all four claws in the air. There were hedgehogs, and a greying leopard, and molting pelicans. Green water surged in the pond, and a couple of hippos surfaced and yawned. Nothing was in a cage, and nothing was trying to eat anything else. Huh, it takes people like that first time, said the old man. He had a wooden leg. We are quite a happy little family. Vimes turned and found himself looking at a small owl. My gods, he said, that's a more pork, isn't it? The old man's face broke into a happy smile. Oh, I can see thee knows thy heraldry, he cackled. Daphne's ancestors came all the way from some islands on the other side of the hub, so they did. Vimes took out his city watch badge and stared at the coat of arms embossed thereon. The old man looked over his shoulder. That's not her, of course, he said, indicating the owl perched on the ark. That was her great-grandma, Olive. A more pork on an ark, see? That is a pune or play on words. Laugh I nearly started. That's about as funny as you gets round here. We could do with a mate for her, tell you the truth, and a female hippo. I mean, his lordship says we've got two hippos, which is right enough. I'm just saying it's not natural for Roderick and Keith. I ain't passing judgment. It's just not right, that's all I'm saying. Uh, what was thy name again? Vimes. Sir Samuel Vimes. My wife made the appointment. The old man cackled again. Ho, ho, ho! Tis usually so. 
Moving quite fast, despite his wooden leg, the old man led the way through the steaming mounds of multi-species dung to the building on the other side of the yard. I expect this is good for the garden, anyway, said Vimes, trying to make conversation. I tried it on my rhubarb, said the old man, pushing open the door, but it grew to twenty feet tall, sir, and then spontaneously caught fire. Mind where the wyvern's been, sir, he's been ill. Oh! What a shame. Never mind, it'll scrape off beautiful when it dries. In thee goes, sire. The hall inside was as quiet and dark as the yard had been full of light and noise. There was the dry, tombstone smell of old books and church towers. Above him, when his eyes got used to the darkness, Vimes could make out hanging flags and banners. There were a few windows, but cobwebs and dead flies meant that the light they allowed in was merely grey. The old man had shut the door and left him alone. Vimes watched through the window as he limped back to continue what he had been doing before Vimes's appearance. What he had been doing was setting up a living coat of arms. There was a large shield. Cabbages, actual cabbages, had been nailed to it. The old man said something that Vimes couldn't hear. The little owl fluttered from its perch and landed on a large ankh that had been glued to the top of the shield. The two hippos flopped out of their pool and took up station on either side. The old man unfolded an easel in front of the scene, placed a canvas on it, picked up a palette and brush, and shouted, Hoopla! The hippos reared, rather arthritically. The owl spread its wings. Good gods, murmured Vimes. I always thought they just made it up. Made it up, sir? Made it up? said a voice behind him. We'd soon be in trouble if we made things up. Oh, dear me, yes. Vimes turned. Another little old man had appeared behind him, blinking happily through thick glasses. He had several scrolls under one arm. "'I'm sorry I couldn't meet you at the gate, but we're very busy at the moment,' he said, holding out his spare hand. "'Croissant rouge pierce we want. "'Uh, you're a small red breakfast roll?' said Vimes, nonplussed. "'No, no, no. It means Red Crescent. It's my title, you see, very ancient title. I'm a herald. <laughs> You'd be Sir Samuel Vimes, yes?' "'Yes.' Red Crescent consulted a scroll. "'Good, good. Uh, how do you feel about weasels?' he said. "'Weasels? We have got some weasels, you see. I know they're not strictly a heraldic animal, but we seem to have some on the strength, and frankly, I think I'm going to have to let them go unless we can persuade someone to adopt them, and that's upset Pardessus Chatin Persuivant. He always locks himself in his shed when he's upset. Pardessus? You mean the old man out there? said Vimes. I mean, why is he... I thought you... I, I mean, a coat of arms is just a design. You don't have to paint it from life. Red Crescent looked shocked. Well, I suppose if you want to make a complete mockery of the whole thing, yes, you could just make it up. You could do that, he said. Anyway, not weasels, then? Personally, I'd just as soon not bother, said Vimes, and certainly not with a weasel. My wife said that dragons would... Happily, the occasion will not arise, said a voice in the shadows. It wasn't the right sort of voice to hear in any kind of light. It was dust-dry. It sounded as if it came from a mouth that had never known the pleasures of spittle. It sounded dead. It was. The bakery thieves considered their options. I've got my hand on my crossbow, said the most enterprising of the three. The most realistic said, Have you? Well, I've got my heart in my mouth. Ooh, said the third. I've got a weak heart, me. Yeah, but what I mean is he's not even wearing a sword. If I take the wolf, the two of you should be able to deal with him with no trouble, right? The one clear thinker looked at Captain Carrot. His armour shone. So did the muscles on his bare arms. Even his knees gleamed. It seems to me that we have a bit of an impasse, or standoff, said Captain Carrot. How about if we throw down the money? said the clear thinker. That would certainly help matters. And you'd let us go? No, but it would definitely count in your favour and I would certainly speak up on your behalf. The bold one with the crossbow licked his lips and glanced from Carrot to the wolf. If you set it on us, I warn you, something's going to get killed, he warned. Yes, it could happen, said Carrot sadly. I'd prefer to avoid that if at all possible. He raised his hands. 
There was something flat and round and about six inches across in each one. This, he said, is dwarf bread, some of Mr. Ironcrust's best. It's not classic battle bread, of course, but it's probably good enough for slicing. Carrot's arm blurred. There was a brief flurry of sawdust, and the flat loaf spun to a stop halfway through the thick timbers of the cart, and about half an inch away from the man with the weak heart, and as it turned out, the fragile bladder, too. The man with the crossbow tore his attention away from the bread only when he felt a slight damp pressure on his wrist. There was no way that an animal could have moved that fast, but there it was, and the wolf's expression contrived to indicate very calmly that if the animal so desired, the pressure could be increased, more or less, indefinitely. <gasps> Call it off, he said, flinging the bow away with his free hand. Tell it to let go. Oh, I never tell her anything, said Carrot. She makes up her own mind. There was a clatter of iron-shod boots, and half a dozen axe-bearing dwarfs raced out of the bakery gates, kicking up sparks as they skidded to a halt beside Carrot. "'Get them!' shouted Mr. Ironcrust. Carrot dropped a hand on top of the dwarf's helmet and turned him round. "'It's me, Mr. Ironcrust,' he said. "'I believe these are the men.' "'Right you are, Captain Carrot,' said the dwarf baker. "'Come on, lads, let's hang em up by the Boorazaka.' Town Hall. "'Oh!' murmured the weak of heart damply. "'Not now, Mr. Ironcrust,' said Carrot patiently. "'We don't practice that punishment in Ankh Morpork, "'because Ankh Morpork doesn't have a town hall.' "'They bashed beyond tight breeches senseless, "'and they kicked Olaf strong in the arm in the bad kazas. "'Eastbow. "'We'll cut that Mr. Ironcrust.' The dwarf baker hesitated, and then, to the amazement and relief of the thieves, took a step backwards. Yeah, all right, Captain Carrot, if you say so. I have business elsewhere, but I would be grateful if you would take them and turn them over to the thieves' guild, said Carrot. The quick thinker went pale. Oh, no, they get really intense about unlicensed thieving, anything but the thieves' guild. Carrot turned. The light caught his face in a certain way. "'Anything,' he said. "'The unlicensed thieves looked at one another, and then all spoke at once. "'The Thieves' Guild, fine, no problem. "'We like the Thieves' Guild, can't let Thieves' Guild, here I come. "'Fine body of men, firm but fair.' "'Good,' said Carrot. "'Then everyone's happy. "'Oh, yes,' he dug into his money pouch. "'Here's five pence for the loaf, Mr. Ironcross. "'I've handled the other one, but you should be able to sand it off with no trouble.' "'The dwarf blinked at the coins.' You want to pay me for saving my money, he said. As a taxpayer, you are entitled to the protection of the watch, said Carrot. There was a delicate pause. Mr. Ironcrust stared at his feet. One or two of the other dwarfs started to snigger. I'll tell you what, said Carrot in a kindly voice. I'll come round when I get a moment and help you fill in the forms. How about that? The thief broke the embarrassed silence. Er, uh, could your little dog let go of my arm, please? The wolf released its grip, jumped down, and padded over to Carrot, who raised his hand to his helmet respectfully. "'Good day to you all,' he said, and strode away. Thieves and victims watched him go. "'Is he real?' said the quick thinker. There was a growl from the baker, then, "'You bastards!' he shouted. "'You bastards!' "'What? Well, 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 you got your money back, haven't you?' Two of his employees had to hold Mr. Iron Crust back. Three years, he said. Three years and no one bothered. Three bloody years and not so much as a knock at the door. And he'll ask me, oh yes, he'll be nice about it. He'll probably even go and get the extra forms so I won't be put to the trouble. Why couldn't you buggers have just run away? Vimes peered around the shadowy, musty room. The voice might as well have come from a tomb. A panicky look crossed the face of the little herald. Perhaps Sir Samuel would be kind enough to step this way, said the voice. It was chilly, clipping every syllable with precision. It was the kind of voice that didn't blink. Ah, uh, that is, in fact, uh, mm, dragon, said Red Crescent. Vimes reached for his sword. Dragon, King of Arms, said the man. King of Arms, said Vimes. Merely a title, said the voice. Pray enter. 
For some reason, the words re-spelled themselves in Vimes' hindbrain as Pray. Enter. King of arms, said the voice of Dragon, as Vimes passed into the shadows of the inner sanctum. You will not need your sword, Commander. I have been Dragon King of Arms for more than five hundred years, but I do not breathe fire, I assure you. Ah, 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 said Vimes. He couldn't see the figure clearly. The light came from a few high and grubby windows and several dozen candles that burned with black-edged flames. There was a suggestion of hunched shoulders in the shape before him. Pray be seated, said Dragon King of Arms, and I would be most indebted if you would look to your left and raise your chin. And expose my neck, you mean, said Vimes. The figure picked up a candelabra and moved closer. A hand so skinny as to be skeletal gripped Vimes's chin and moved it gently this way and that. Ah, yes. You have the Vimes profile, certainly, but not the Vimes ears. <gasps> of course, your maternal grandmother was a clamp. The Vimes' hand gripped the Vimes' sword again. There was only one type of person that had that much strength in a body so apparently frail. I thought so. You are a vampire, he said. You're a bloody vampire. <gasps> it might have been a laugh. It might have been a cough. Yes. Vampire indeed. Yes. I've heard about your views on vampires. Not really alive, but not dead enough, I believe you have said. I think that is rather clever. <laughs> Vampire, yes. Mm -hmm. Bloody, no. Black puddings, yes. The acme of the butcher's art, yes. And if all else fails, there are plenty of kosher butchers down in long hog meat. <laughs> ah, yes. We all live in the best way we can. <laughs> Virgins are safe from me <laughs> for several hundred years. More's the pretty. <laughs> the shape and the pool of candlelight moved away. I'm afraid your time has been needlessly wasted, Command Vimes. Vimes' eyes were growing accustomed to the flickering light. The room was full of books in piles. None of them were on shelves. Each one sprouted bookmarks like squashed fingers. I don't understand, he said. Either Dragon King of Arms had very hunched shoulders, or there were wings under his shapeless robe. Some of them could fly like a bat, Vimes recalled. He wondered how old this one was. They could live almost forever. I believe you're here because it is considered <laughs> appropriate that you have a coat of arms. I am afraid that this is not possible. <laughs> a Vimes coat of arms has existed, but it cannot be resurrected. It would be against the rules. What rules? There was a thump as a book was taken down and opened. I'm sure you know your ancestry, Commander. Your father was Thomas Vimes. His father was William Vimes. It's old stone face, isn't it? said Vimes flatly. It's something to do with old stone face. Indeed. <laughs> Suffer not injustice, Vimes, your ancestor, old Stoneface, indeed, as he was called, commander of the City Watch in 1688, and a regicide. He murdered the last king of Ankh-Morpork, as every schoolboy knows. Executed? The shoulders shrugged. Nevertheless, the family crest was, as we say in heraldry, 
Execritus est ex altitudine, that is to say, depositatum de latrina, a destroyed band, made incapable of resurrection, lands confiscated, house pulled down, page torn out of history. <laughs> you know, Commander, it is interesting that so many of <laughs> old stone faces' descendants, the inverted commas dropped neatly around the nickname like an old lady carefully picking up something nasty in a pair of tongs, have been officers of the watch. I believe, Commander, that you too have acquired the nickname. <laughs> I have wondered whether there is some inherited urge to expunge the infamy. <laughs> Vimes gritted his teeth. Are you telling me I can't have a coat of arms? This is so. <sighs> because my ancestor killed a... He paused. No. It wasn't even execution, he said. You execute a human being, you slaughter an animal. He was the king, said Dragon mildly. Oh, yes, and it turned out that down in the dungeons he had machines for... Commander, said the vampire, holding up his hands. I feel you do not understand me. Whatever else he was... He was the king. You see, a crown is not like a watchman's helmet. <laughs> Even when you take it off, it's still on the head. Stoneface took it off all right, but the king did not even get a trial. No willing judge could be found, said Vimes. Except you, that is, uh, your ancestor. Well, someone had to do it. Some monsters should not walk under the living sky. Dragon found the page he had been looking for and turned the book around. This was his escutcheon, he said. Vimes looked down at the familiar sign of the Moorpork Owl perched on an ark. It was atop a shield divided into four quarters with a symbol in each quarter. What's this crown with a dagger through it? Oh, a traditional symbol <sighs> indicates his role as a defender of the crown. Really? And a bunch of rods with an axe in it? He pointed. A fasces symbolizes that he is, uh, was an officer of the law, and the axe was an interesting harbinger of things to come, yes? But axes, I'm afraid, solve nothing. Vimes stared at the third quarter. It contained a painting of what seemed to be a marble bust, symbolizing his nickname, Old Stone Face, said Dragon helpfully. He asked that some reference be made. Sometimes heraldry is nothing more than the art of punning. And this last one, a bunch of grapes, bit of a boozer, was he? said Vimes sourly. No. <laughs> Word play. Vimes equals Vimes. Oh, the art of bad cunning, said Vimes. I bet that had you people rolling on the floor. Dragon shut the book and sighed. There is seldom a reward for those who do what must be done. Alas, such is precedent, and I am powerless. Hmm. The old voice brightened up. But still, I was extremely pleased, Commander, to hear of your marriage to Lady Sybil, an excellent lineage, one of the most noble families in the city. Ah, the Ramkins, the Selaches, the Venturis, the Nobses, of course. That's it, is it? said Vimes. I'll just go now. I seldom get visitors, said Dragon. Generally people are seen by the heralds, but I thought you should get a proper explanation. <laughs> We're so busy now. Once we dealt with real heraldry, but this, they tell me, is the century of the fruit bat. 
Now it seems that as soon as a man opens his second meat pie shop, he feels impelled to consider himself a gentleman. He waved a thin white hand at three coats of arms pinned in a row on a board. The butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, he sneered, but genteelly. Well, the candle maker, in point of fact, nothing will do but that we burrow through the records and prove them acceptably armigerous. Vimes glanced at the three shields. Haven't I seen that one before, he said. <gasps> ah, Mr. Arthur Carey, the candle maker, said Dragon. Suddenly business is booming and he feels he must be a gentleman. A shield bisected by a bend sinister d'une mèche en métal gris. That is to say, a steel grey shield indicating his personal determination and zeal. How zealous <laughs> these businessmen are, bisected by a wick. Upper half, a chandelle in a fenêtre avec rideau houlon. A candle lighting a window with a warm glow. <laughs> Lower half, two chandeliers illuminés, indicating the wretched man sells candles to rich and poor alike. Fortunately, his father was a harbour master, which fact allows us to stretch ourselves a little with the crest of a lamp au poisson, fish-shaped lamp, indicating both this and his son's current profession. The motto I left in the common modern tongue and is, Art brought forth the candle. I'm sorry, <laughs> it was naughty. But I couldn't resist it. My sides ache, said Vimes. Something kicked his brain, trying to get attention. This one is for Mr. Gerhardt Sock, president of the Butcher's Guild, said Dragon. His wife's told him a coat of arms is the thing to have, and who are we to argue with the daughter of a tripe merchant? So we've made him a shield of red for blood, and blue and white stripes for a butcher's apron, bisected by a string of sausages, centralis, a cleaver held in a gloved hand, a boxing glove, which is uh, <sighs> the best we could do for sock. Motto is, Futuris meus est in visceris which translates as, My future is in the entrails, both relating to his profession and uh, uh, alluding to the old practice of telling the future from entrails, said Vimes. Amazing. Whatever was trying to get into his attention was really jumping up and down now. While this one <sighs> is for Rudolf Potts of the Baker's Guild, said Dragon, pointing to the third shield with a twig-thin finger. Can you read it, Commander? Vimes gave it a gloomy stare. Well, it's divided into three, and there's a rose of flame and a pot, he said. The uh, bakers use fire, and the pot's for water, I suppose. And a pun on the name, said Dragon. But unless he's called Rosie, ah, uh, then Vimes blinked. A rose is a flower. Oh, good grief. Flower, 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 fired and water. The pot looks like a gazunder to me, though, a chamber pot. The old word for baker was pistor, said Dragon. Why, Commander, we shall make a herald of you yet. <sighs> And the motto? Quad subigo farinam, said Vimes, and wrinkled his forehead. Because farinaceous means to do with corn or flour, doesn't it? Oh, no. Because I need the dough. Dragon clapped his hands. Well done, sir. This place must simply rock on those long winter evenings, said Vimes. And that's heraldry, is it? Crossword clues and plays on words. Of course, there is a great deal more, 
said the dragon. These are simple. We more or less have to make them up. Whereas the escutcheon of an old family, such as the Nobbses. Nobbs? said Vimes as the penny dropped. That's it. You said Nobbs. Before, when you were talking about old families. Ah, what? Oh, indeed, yes. Oh, yes, a fine old family, although now, sadly, in decay. You don't mean knobs, as in corporal knobs, said Vimes, horror edging his words. A book thumped open. In the orange light, Vimes had a vague upside-down glimpse of shields and a rambling, unpruned family tree. My word! Would that be a C.W. St. J. Nobbs? Uh, yes, yes. Son of Scona Nobbs and a lady referred to here as Maisie of Elm Street? Probably. Grandson of Sloop Nobbs? That sounds about right. Who was the illegitimate son of Edward St. John de Nobbs, Earl of Ankh, and uh, a parlour maid of unknown lineage? Good gods! The Earl died without issue, except that which uh, ha, ha, resulted in sloop. We had not been able to trace the scion hitherto, at any rate. Good gods. You know the gentleman? Vimes regarded with amazement a serious and positive sentence about Corporal Nobbs that included the word gentleman. Ah, uh, yes, he said. Is he a man of property? Only other people's. Well, uh, do tell him there is no land or money now, of course, but the title is still extant. Sorry, uh, let me make sure I understand this. Corporal Nobbs, my Corporal Nobbs, is the Earl of Ark. He would have to satisfy us as to proof of his lineage, but yes, it would appear so. Vimes stared into the gloom. Thus far in his life, Corporal Nobbs would have been unlikely to satisfy the examiners as to his species. Good gods, Vimes said yet again, and I suppose he gets a coat of arms. A particularly fine one. <sighs> oh. Vimes hadn't even wanted a coat of arms. An hour ago, he'd have cheerfully avoided disappointment, as he had done so many times before. But... Nobby, he said. Good gods. Well, well, this has been a very happy meeting, said Dragon. I do so like to keep the records up to date. <sighs> Incidentally, how is young Captain Carrot getting along? I'm told his young lady is a werewolf. <sighs> really, said Vimes. Ah. In the dark, Dragon made a movement that might have been a conspiratorial tap on the side of the nose. We know these things. Captain Carrot is doing well, said Vimes, as icily as he could manage. Captain Carrot always does well. He slammed the door when he went out. The candle flames wavered. Constable Angua walked out of an alleyway doing up her belt. That went very well, I thought, said Carrot, and will go some way to earning us the respect of the community. Pooh! That man's sleeve! I doubt if he even knows the meaning of the word laundry, said Angua, wiping her mouth. Automatically they fell into step, the energy-saving policeman's walk, where the pendulum weight of the leg is used to propel the walker along with the minimum of effort. Walking was important, Vimes had always said, and because Vimes had said it, Carrot believed it. Walking and talking. Walk far enough and talk to enough people, and sooner or later you had an answer. The respect of the community, thought Angua. That was a Carrot phrase. Well, in fact, it was a Vimes phrase, although Sir Samuel usually spat after he said it. But Carrot believed it.
It was Carrot who'd suggested to the patrician that hardened criminals should be given the chance to serve the community by redecorating the homes of the elderly, lending a new terror to old age, and given Ark Morpork's crime rate, leading to at least one old lady having her front room wallpapered so many times in six months that now she could only get into it sideways. Commander Vimes, on the other hand, was all for giving criminals a short, sharp shock. It really depended on how tightly they could be tied to the lightning rod. I found something very interesting that you will be very interested to see, said Carrot after a while. That's interesting, said Angua, but I'm not going to tell you what it is, because I want it to be a surprise, said Carrot. Oh, good. Angua walked in thought for a while and then said, I wonder if it will be as surprising as the collection of rock samples you showed me last week. Oh, that was good, wasn't it? said Carrot enthusiastically. I've been along that street dozens of times and never suspected there was a mineral museum there. All those silicates. Amazing. You'd imagine people would flock into it, wouldn't you? Yes, I can't think why they don't. Angua reminded herself that Carrot appeared to have in his soul not even a trace element of irony. She told herself that it wasn't his fault he'd been brought up by dwarfs in some mine, and really did think that bits of rock were interesting. The week before they'd visited an iron foundry. That had been interesting, too. And yet, and yet you couldn't help liking Carrot. Even people he was arresting liked Carrot. Even old ladies living in a permanent smell of fresh paint liked Carrot. She liked Carrot a lot which was going to make leaving him all the harder. She was a werewolf. That's all there was to it. You either spent your time trying to make sure people didn't find out, or you let them find out and spent your time watching them keep their distance and whisper behind your back. Although, of course, you'd have to turn round to watch that. Carrot didn't mind, but he minded that other people minded. He minded that even quite friendly colleagues tended to carry a bit of silver somewhere on their person. She could see it upsetting him. She could see the tensions building up, and he didn't know how to deal with them. It was just as her father had said, get involved with humans other than at mealtimes, and you might as well jump down a silver mine. Apparently, there's going to be a huge firework display after the celebrations next year, said Carrot. I like fireworks. It beats me why Aunt Morpork wants to celebrate the fact that it had a civil war three hundred years ago, said Angua, coming back to the here and now. Why not? We won, said Carrot. Yes, but you lost, too. Always look on the positive side, that's what I say. Ah, oh, here we are. Angua looked up at the sign. She'd learned to read dwarf runes now. Dwarf Bread Museum, she said. Gosh, I can't wait. Carrot nodded happily and pushed open the door. There was a smell of ancient crusts. Cooey, Mr. Hopkinson, he called. There was no reply. He does go out sometimes, he said. Probably when the excitement gets too much for him, said Angua. Hopkinson? That's not a dwarf name, is it? Oh, he's human, said Carrot, stepping inside, but an amazing authority. Bread is his life. He wrote the definitive work on offensive baking. Well, uh, since he's not here, I'll just take two tickets and leave tuppence on the desk. It didn't look as though Mr. Hopkinson got many visitors. There was dust on the floor and dust on the display cases, and a lot of dust on the exhibits. Most of them were the classic cowpat-like shape, an echo of their taste. But there were also buns, close combat crumpets, deadly throwing toast, and a huge dusty array of other shapes devised by a race that went in for food fighting in a big and above all terminal way. What are we looking for? Angua said. She sniffed. There was a nastily familiar tang in the air. It's, are you ready for this? It's the battle bread of Barayan Bloodaxe, said Carrot, rummaging in a desk by the entrance. A loaf of bread? You brought me here to see a loaf of bread? She sniffed again. Yes, blood, fresh blood. That's right, said Carrot. It's only going to be here a couple of weeks on loan. It's the actual bread he personally wielded at the Battle of Coombe Valley, killing fifty-seven trolls, although, and here Carrot's tone changed down from enthusiasm to civic respectability, 
That was a long time ago and we shouldn't let ancient history blind us to the realities of a multi-ethnic society in the century of the fruit bat. There was a creak of a door. Then, this battle bread, said Angua indistinctly, black, isn't it? Quite a lot bigger than normal bread. Yes, that's right, said Carrot. And Mr. Hopkinson, short man, little white pointy beard, that's him. And his head, all smashed in. What? I think you'd better come and look, said Angua, backing away. Dragon King of Arms sat alone among his candles. So that was Commander Sir Samuel Rhymes, he mused. Stupid man! Clearly can't see beyond the chip on his shoulder, and people like that rise to high office these days. <sighs> Still, such people have their uses, which presumably is why Vetinari has elevated him. Stupid men are often capable of things the clever would not dare to contemplate. He sighed, and pulled another tome towards him. It was not much bigger than many others which lined his study, a fact which might have surprised anyone who knew its contents. He was rather proud of it. It was quite an unusual piece of work, but he had been surprised or would have been surprised had Dragon been really surprised at anything at all for the last hundred years or so, at how easy some of it had been. He didn't even need to read it now, he knew it by heart. The family trees were properly planted, the words were down there on the page, and all he had to do was sing along. The first page was headed, The Descent of King Carrot the First, by the grace of the gods King of Ark Morpork. A long and complex family tree occupied the next dozen pages until it reached Married. The words there were merely penciled in. Delphine Angua von Überwald, read the dragon aloud, Father and uh -huh, Sire Baron Guy von Uberwald, also known as Silvertail, Mother Madame Seraphine Sox Bloomberg, also known as Yellow Fang of Genua. It had been quite an achievement that part. He had expected his agents to have some difficulty with the more lupine areas of Angua's ancestry but it turned out that mountain wolves took quite a lot of interest in that sort of thing as well. Angua's ancestors had definitely been among the leaders of the pack. Dragon King of Arms grinned. As far as he was concerned, species was a secondary consideration. What really mattered in an individual was a good pedigree. Ah, well, that was the future as it might have been. He pushed the book aside. One of the advantages of a life much longer than average was that you saw how fragile the future was. Men said things like, peace in our time, or an empire that will last a thousand years, and less than half a lifetime later no one even remembered who they were, let alone what they had said, or where the mob had buried their ashes. What changed history were smaller things. Often a few strokes of the pen would do the trick. He pulled another tome towards him. The frontispiece bore the words, The Descent of King... Now, what would the man call himself? Uh, that at least was not calculable. Oh, well. Dragon picked up his pencil and wrote, Knobs. He smiled in the candlelit room. People kept on talking about the true King of Ankh Morpork, but history taught a cruel lesson. It said, often in words of blood, that the true King was the one who got crowned. Books filled this room, too. That was the first impression, one of dank, oppressive bookishness. The late Father Tubelcheck was sprawled across a drift of fallen books. He was certainly dead. No one could have bled that much and still been alive, or survived for long with a head like a deflated football. Someone must have hit him with a lump hammer. This old lady came running out, screaming, said Constable Visit, saluting. So I went in, and it was just like this, sir. Just like this, Constable Visit? Yes, sir, and the name's Visit the Infidel with Explanatory Pamphlets, sir. Who was the old lady? She says she's Mrs. Kanaki, sir. She says she always brings him his meals. She says she does for him. Does for him? You know, sir, cleaning and sweeping. There was indeed a tray on the floor, along with a broken bowl and some spilled porridge. 
The lady who did for the old man had been shocked to find that someone else had done for him first. Did she touch him? he said. She says not, sir. Which meant the old priest had somehow achieved the neatest death Vimes had ever seen. His hands were crossed on his chest. His eyes had been closed. And something had been put in his mouth. It looked like a rolled-up piece of paper. It gave the corpse a disconcertingly jaunty look, as though he'd decided to have a last cigarette after dying. Vimes gingerly picked out the little scroll and unrolled it. It was covered with meticulously written but unfamiliar symbols. What made them particularly noteworthy was the fact that their author had apparently made use of the only liquid lying around in huge quantities. Yuck, said Vimes. Written in blood. Does this mean anything to anyone? Yes, sir. Vimes rolled his eyes. Yes, Constable Visit. Visit the infidel with explanatory pamphlets, sir, said Constable Visit, looking hurt. The infidel with explanatory pamphlets. Constable Visit was an Omnian, whose country's traditional approach to evangelism was to put unbelievers to torture and the sword. Things had become a lot more civilized these days, but Omnians still had a strenuous and indefatigable approach to spreading the word, and had merely changed the nature of the weapons. Constable Visit spent his days off in company with his co-religious Smite the Unbeliever with Cunning Arguments, ringing doorbells and causing people to hide behind the furniture everywhere in the city. I was just about to say it, Constable, said Vimes. Well, it's an ancient Clatchian script, said Constable Visit. One of the desert tribes called it the Senotines, sir. They had a sophisticated but fundamentally flawed... Yes, 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 said Vimes, who could recognize the verbal foot getting ready to stick itself in the oral door. But do you know what it means? I could find out, sir. Good. Incidentally, were you able by any chance to find time to have a look at those leaflets I gave you the other day, sir? Uh, been very busy, said Vimes automatically. Not to worry, sir, said Visit, and smiled the one smile of those doing good against great odds. When you've got a moment, we'll be fine. The old books that had been knocked from the shelves had spilled their pages everywhere. There were splashes of blood on many of them. Some of these look religious, Vimes said. You might find something. He turned. Detritus, have a look round, will you? Detritus paused in the act of laboriously drawing a chalk line around the body. Yes, sir. What for, sir? Anything you find. Right, sir. With a grunt, Vimes hunkered down and prodded at a grey smear on the floor. Dirt, he said. You get dirt on floors, sir, said Detritus helpfully. Except this is off-white. We're on black loam, said Vimes. Ah, said Sergeant Detritus. A clue. Could just be dirt, of course. There was something else. Someone had made an attempt to tidy up the books. They'd stacked several dozen of them in one neat towering pile, one book wide, largest books on the bottom, all the edges squared up with geometrical precision. Now that I don't understand, said Vimes. There's a fight. The old man is viciously attacked. Then someone, maybe it was him, dying, maybe it was the murderer, writes something down using the poor man's own blood, and rolls it up neatly and pops it into his mouth like a sweetie. Then he does die, and someone shuts his eyes and makes him tidy and pile these books up neatly, and does what? Walks out into the seething hurly-burly that is Ark Morpork? Sergeant Detritus's honest brow furrowed with the effort of thought. Could be, er... Uh... Could be there's a footprint outside the window, he said. That's always a clue worth looking for. Vimes sighed. Detritus, despite a room temperature IQ, made a good copper and a damn good sergeant. He had that special type of stupidity that was hard to fool. But the only thing more difficult than getting him to grasp an idea was getting him to let go of it. Detritus was particularly good when it came to asking questions. He had three basic ones. They were the direct, did you do it? The persistent, are you sure it wasn't you what done it? And the subtle, it was you what done it, wasn't it? Although they were not the most cunning questions ever devised, Detritus's talent was to go on patiently asking them for hours on end until he got the right answer, which was generally something like, yes, yes, I did it, I did it, now please tell me what it was I did. Detritus, he said as kindly as possible, 
There's a thirty-foot drop into the river outside the window. There won't be... He paused. This was the river Ankh, after all. Any footprints would be bound to have oozed back by now, he corrected himself, almost certainly. He looked outside, though, just in case. The river gurgled and sucked below him. There were no footprints, even on its famously crusted surface. There was another smear of dirt on the windowsill. Vimes scratched some up and sniffed at it. Looks like some more white clay, he said. He couldn't think of any white clay around the city. Once you got outside the walls, it was thick black loam all the way to the ram tops. A man walking across it would be two inches taller by the time he got to the other side of a field. White clay, he said. Where the hell is white clay country round here? It's a mystery, said Detritus. Vimes grinned mirthlessly. It was a mystery, and he didn't like mysteries. Mysteries had a way of getting bigger if you didn't solve them quickly. Mysteries popped. Mere murders happened all the time, and usually even detritus could solve them. When a distraught woman was standing over a fallen husband holding a right-angled poker and crying, He never should have said that about our Neville, there was only a limited amount you could do to spin out the case beyond the next coffee break. And when various men or parts thereof were hanging from or nailed to various fixtures in the mended drum on a Saturday night, and the other clientele were all looking innocent, you didn't even need a detritic intelligence to work out what had been happening. He looked down at the late Father Tubelcheck. It was amazing he'd bled so much, with his pipe-cleaner arms and toast-racked chest. He certainly wouldn't have been able to put up much of a fight. Vimes leaned down and gently raised one of the corpse's eyelids. A milky blue eye with a black centre looked back at him from wherever the old priest was now. A religious old man, who lived in a couple of little pokey rooms, and obviously didn't go out much from the smell. What kind of threat could he... Constable Visit poked his head around the door. There's a dwarf down here with no eyebrows and a frizzled beard. Says you told him to come, sir, he said. And some citizens say Father Tubalcheck is their priest, and they want to bury him decently. Ah, oh, that'll be little bottom. Send him up, said Vimes, straightening. Tell the others they'll have to wait. Littlebottom climbed the stairs, took in the scene, and managed to reach the window in time to be sick. Better now, said Vimes eventually. Uh, yes, uh, I hope so. I'll leave you to it, then. Uh, what exactly did you want me to do, said Littlebottom, but Vimes was already halfway down the stairs. Angua growled. It was the signal to Carrot that he could open his eyes again. Women, as Colon had remarked to Carrot once when he thought the lad needed advice, could be funny about little things. Maybe they didn't like to be seen without their makeup on, or insisted on buying smaller suitcases than men, even though they always took more clothes. In Angua's case, she didn't like to be seen en route from human to werewolf shape, or vice versa. It was just something she had a thing about, she said. Carrot could see her in either shape, but not in the various ones she occupied on the way through in case he never wanted to see her again. Through werewolf eyes, the world was different. For one thing, it was in black and white. At least, that small part of it which as a human she thought of as vision was monochrome. But who cared that vision had to take a back seat when smell drove instead, laughing and sticking its arm out of the window and making rude gestures at all the other senses? Afterwards, she always remembered the odours as colours and sounds. Blood was rich brown and deep base. Stale bread was a surprisingly tinkly bright blue, and every human being was a four-dimensional kaleidoscopic symphony. For nasal vision meant seeing through time as well as space. A man could stand still for a minute, and an hour later there'd still be to the nose his odours, barely faded. She prowled the aisles of the dwarf bread museum, muzzled to the ground. Then she went out into the alley for a while and tried there too. After five minutes, she padded back to Carrot and gave him the signal again. When he reopened his eyes, she was pulling her shirt on over her head. That was one thing where humans had the edge. You couldn't beat a pair of hands. I thought you'd be down the street and following someone, he said. Follow who? said Angua. Pardon? I can smell him, and you, and the bread, and that's it. Nothing else. Dirt, dust, the usual stuff. Oh, there are some old traces, days old. I know you were in here last week, for example. 
There are lots of smells. Grease, meat, pine resin for some reason, old food. But I'll swear no living thing's been in here in the last day or so but him and us. But you told me everyone leaves a trail. They do. Carrots looked down at the late curator. However you phrased it, however broadly you applied your definitions, he definitely couldn't have committed suicide. Not with a loaf of bread. Vampires? said Carrot. They can fly. Angua sighed. Carrot, I could tell if a vampire had been in here in the last month. Well, there's almost half a dollar in pennies in the drawer, said Carrot. Anyway, a thief would be here for the battle bread, wouldn't they? It is a very valuable cultural artifact. Has the poor man got any relatives? said Angua. He's got an elderly sister, I believe. Come in once a month just to have a chat. He lets me handle the exhibits, you know. That must be fun said Angua, before she could stop herself. It's very... satisfying. Yes, said Carrot solemnly. It reminds me of home. Angua sighed and stepped into the room behind the little museum. It was like the back rooms of museums everywhere, full of junk and things there is no room for on the shelves, and also items of doubtful provenance, such as coins dated 52 B.C., there were some benches with shards of dwarf bread on them, a tidy tool rack with various sizes of kneading hammer, and papers all over the place. Against one wall, and occupying a large part of the room, was an oven. He researches old recipes, said Carrot, who seemed to feel he had to promote the old man's expertise even in death. Angua opened the oven door. Warmth spilt out into the room. Hell of a bake oven, she said. What are these things? Ah... I see he's been making drop scones, said Carrot, quite deadly at short range. She shut the door. Let's go back to the yard and they can send someone out. Angua stopped. These were always the dangerous moments, just after a shape change this close to full moon. It wasn't so bad when she was a wolf. She was still as intelligent, or at least she felt as intelligent, although life was a lot simpler, and so she was probably just extremely intelligent for a wolf. It was when she became a human again that things were difficult. For a few minutes, until the morphic field fully reasserted itself, all her senses were still keen, smells were still incredibly strong, and her ears could hear sounds way outside the stunted human range. And she could think more about the things she experienced. A wolf could sniff a lamppost and know that old Bonzo had been passed yesterday and was feeling a bit under the weather and was still being fed tripe by his owner, but a human mind could actually think about the whys and wherefores. There is something else, she said, and breathed in gently. Faint, not a living thing, but can't you smell it? Something like dirt, but not quite. It's kind of yellow-orange. Um, said Carrot tactfully. Some of us don't have your nose. I've smelled it before, somewhere in this town. I can't remember where. It's strong, stronger than the other smells. It's a muddy smell. Ha! Well, on these streets, no, no, it's not exactly mud. Sharper, more treble. You know, sometimes I envy you. It must be nice to be a wolf just for a while. It has its drawbacks. Like fleas, she thought, as they locked up the museum, and the food, and the constant nagging feeling that you should be wearing three bras at once. She kept telling herself she had it under control, and she did, in a way. She prowled the city on moonlit nights, and, okay, there was the occasional chicken, but she always remembered where she'd been, and went round next day to shove some money under the door. It was hard to be a vegetarian who had to pick bits of meat out of her teeth in the morning. She was definitely on top of it, though. Definitely. She reassured herself. It was Angua's mind that prowled the night, not a werewolf mind. She was almost entirely sure of that. A werewolf wouldn't stop at chickens, not by a long way. She shuddered. Who was she kidding? It was easy to be a vegetarian by day. It was preventing yourself from becoming a humanitarian at night that took the real effort. The first clocks were striking eleven as Vimes' sedan chair wobbled to a halt outside the patrician's palace. Commander Vimes's legs were beginning to give out, 
but he ran up five flights of stairs as fast as possible and collapsed on a chair in the waiting salon. Minutes went past. You didn't knock on the patrician's door. He summoned you in the certain knowledge that you would be there. Vimes sat back, enjoying a moment's peace. Something inside his coat went bing, bing, bingly, bing. He sighed, pulled out a leather-bound package about the size of a small book, and opened it. A friendly yet slightly worried face peered up at him from its cage. Yes, said Vimes. Eleven a.m. Appointment with the patrician. Yes. Well, it's five past now. Ah, uh, so you've had it, have you? said the imp. No. Shall I go on remembering it, or what? No. Anyway, you didn't remind me about the College of Arms at ten. The imp looked panic-stricken. That's Tuesday, isn't it? Could have sworn it was Tuesday. It was an hour ago. Oh! The imp was downcast. Oh, all right, sorry. Um, hey, could I tell you what time it is in Clatch, if you like? Or Genua? Or Hong Hong? Any of those places. You name it. I don't need to know the time in Clatch. You might, said the imp desperately. Think how people would be impressed if, during a dull moment of the conversation, you could say, Incidentally, in Clatch, it's an hour ago. Or best pelagic. Or if he'd ask me, go on, go on, I don't mind. Any of those places? Vimes sighed inwardly. He had a notebook. He took notes in it. It was always useful. And then Sybil, God bless her, had brought him this fifteen-function imp which did so many other things, although as far as he could see at least ten of its functions consisted of apologising for its inefficiency in the other five. You could take a memo, Vimes said. Wow! Really? Gosh, OK. Right. No problem! Vimes cleared his throat. See Corporal Nobbs re-timekeeping. Also re-earled them. Uh, er, sorry, uh, is this the memo? Yes. Sorry, you should have said memo first. I'm pretty certain it's in the manual. All right, it was a memo. Um, sorry, you have to say it again. Memo. See Corporal Nobbs re-timekeeping, also re earldom Got it, said the imp. Would you like to be reminded of this at any particular time? The time here, said Vimes nastily, or the time in, say, Clatch. As a matter of fact, I can tell you what time it... I think I'll write in my notebook, if you don't mind, said Vimes. Oh, well, if you prefer. I can recognise handwriting, said the imp proudly. I'm quite advanced. Vimes pulled out his notebook and held it up. Like this, he said. The imp squinted for a moment. Yep, it said. That's handwriting, sure enough. Curly bits, spiky bits, all joined together. Yep, handwriting. I'd recognise it anywhere. Aren't you supposed to tell me what it says? The imp looked wary. Says, he said. It's supposed to make noises. Vimes put the battered book away and shut the lid of the organiser. Then he sat back and carried on waiting. Someone very clever, certainly someone much cleverer than whoever had trained that imp, must have made the clock for the patrician's waiting room. It went tick-tock like any other clock. But somehow, and against all usual horological practice, the tick and the tock were irregular. Tick, tock, tick, and then the merest fraction of a second longer before, tock, tick, tock, and then a tick a fraction of a second earlier than the mind's ear was now prepared for. The effect was enough, after ten minutes, to reduce the thinking processes of even the best prepared to a sort of porridge. The patrician must have paid the clockmaker quite highly. The clock said quarter past eleven. Vimes walked over to the door, and despite precedent, knocked, gently. There was no sound from within, no murmur of distant voices. He tried the handle. The door was unlocked. Lord Vetinari had always said that punctuality was the politeness of princes. Vimes went in. Cheery dutifully scraped up the crumbly white dirt and then examined the corpse of the late Father Tubalchek. Anatomy was an important study at the Alchemists' Guild, owing to the ancient theory that the human body represented a microcosm of the universe, although when you saw one opened up it was hard to imagine which part of the universe was small and purple and went blomp blomp when you prodded it. But in any case, you tended to pick up practical anatomy as you went along, and sometimes scraped it off the walls as well. When new students tried an experiment that was particularly successful in terms of explosive force, the result was often a cross between a major laboratory refit and a game of hunt the other kidney. 
The man had been killed by being repeatedly hit around the head. That was about all you could say. Some kind of very heavy, blunt instrument. It is a pervasive and beguiling myth that the people who design instruments of death end up being killed by them. There is almost no foundation, in fact. Colonel Shrapnel wasn't blown up. Monsieur Guillotine died with his head on. Colonel Gatling wasn't shot. If it hadn't been for the murder of Kosh and Blackjack maker Sir William Blunt Instrument in an alleyway, the rumour would never have got started. What else did Vimes expect Cheery to do? He looked carefully at the rest of the body. There were no other obvious signs of violence, although there were a few specks of blood on the man's fingers, but then there was blood everywhere. A couple of fingernails were torn. Tubalcheck had put up a fight, or at least had tried to shield himself with his hands. Cheery looked more closely at the fingers. There was something piled under the nails. It had a waxy sheen like thick grease. He couldn't imagine why it should be there, but maybe his job was to find out. He conscientiously took an envelope out of his pocket and scraped the stuff into it, sealed it up and numbered it. Then he took his iconograph out of its box and prepared to take a picture of the corpse. As he did so, something caught his eye. Father Tubalcheck lay there, one eye still open as Vimes had left it, winking at eternity. Cheery looked closer. He thought he'd imagined it, but even now he wasn't sure the mind could play tricks. He opened the little door of the iconograph and spoke to the imp inside. "'Can you paint a picture of his eye, Sidney?' he said. The imp squinted out through the lens. "'Just the eye?' it squeaked. "'Yes, as big as you can. You're sick, mister.' "'And shut up,' said Cheery. He propped the box on the table and sat back. From inside the box there came the swish-swish of brush strokes. At last there was the sound of a handle being turned and a slightly damp picture rustled out of a slot. Cheery peered at it. Then he knocked on the box. The hatch opened. Yes? Bigger. So big it fills the whole paper. In fact... Cheery squinted at the picture in his hands. Just paint the pupil, the bit in the middle. So it fills the whole paper? You're weird. Cheery propped the box nearer. There was a clicking of gears as the imp wound the lenses out, and then a few more seconds of busy brushwork. Another damp picture unwound. It showed a big black disc. Well, mainly black. Cheery looked closer. There was a hint. Just a hint. He rapped on the box again. Yes, Mr. Dwarf Weird Person, said the imp. The bit in the middle, big as you can, thank you. The lenses wound out yet further. Cheery waited anxiously. In the next room he could hear Detritus patiently moving around. The paper wound out for the third time, and the hatch opened. That's it, said the imp. I've run out of black. And the paper was black, except for the tiny little area that wasn't. The door to the stairs burst open and Constable Visit came in, borne along by the pressure of a small crowd. Cheery guiltily thrust the paper into his pocket. This is intolerable, said a small man with a long black beard. We demand you lack of sin. Uh, who are you, young man? I'm che I'm, I'm, I'm Corporal Littlebottom, said Cheery. Look, I've got a badge. Well, Corporal, said the man, I am Wengel Radley, and I'm a man of some standing in this community, and I demand that you let us have poor Father Tubalcheck this minute. Well, we're uh, uh, trying to find out who killed him, Cheery began. There was a movement behind Cheery, and the faces in front of him suddenly looked very worried indeed. He turned to see Detritus in the doorway to the next room. Everything okay, said the troll. The changed fortunes of the watch had allowed Detritus to have a proper breastplate rather than a piece of elephant battle armour. As was normal practice for the uniform of a sergeant, the armourer had attempted to do a stylized representation of muscles on it. As far as Detritus was concerned, he hadn't been able to get them all in. Is there any trouble? he said. The crowd backed away. None at all, officer, said Mr. Radley. You were just loomed suddenly, that's all. That's correct, said Detritus. I am a loomer. It often happens suddenly, so there's no trouble then. No trouble whatsoever, officer. Amazing thing, trouble, rumbled Detritus thoughtfully. Always I go looking for trouble, and when I find it, people say it ain't there. Mr. Radley drew himself up. But we 
"'Want to take Father Tuplecheck away to bury him,' he said. Detritus turned to Cheery Littlebottom. "'You done everything you need?' "'I suppose so.' "'He dead?' "'Oh, yes. He gonna get any better?' "'Better than dead? I doubt it. Okay, then, you people can take him away.' The two watchmen stood aside as the body was carried down the stairs. "'Why are you taking pictures of the dead man?' said Detritus. "'Well, uh, it might be helpful to see how he was lying.' Detritus nodded sagely. "'Ah, he was lying, was he? And him a holy man, too?' Littlebottom pulled out the picture and looked at it again. It was almost black. But a constable arrived at the bottom of the stairs. Is there someone up there called? There was a muffled snigger. <coughs> <laughs> Cheery little bottom. Yes, said little bottom gloomily. Well, Commander Vine says you've got to come to the Patrician's Palace right now. All right. That's Corporal Little Bottom you're talking to, said Detritus. It's all right, said little bottom. Nothing could make it any worse. Rumor is information distilled so finely that it can filter through anything. It does not need doors and windows. Sometimes it doesn't even need people. It can exist free and wild, running from ear to ear, without ever touching lips. It had escaped already. From the high window of the patrician's bedroom, Sam Vimes could see people drifting towards the palace. There wasn't a mob. There wasn't even what you might call a crowd but the Brownian motion of the streets was bouncing more and more people in his direction. He relaxed slightly when he saw one or two guards come through the gates. On the bed, Lord Vetinari opened his eyes. Ah, Commander Vimes, he murmured. What's been happening, sir? said Vimes. I appear to be lying down, Vimes. You were in your office, sir, unconscious. Dear me, I must have been overdoing it. Well, thank you. If you would be kind enough to help me up. Lord Vetinari tried to pull himself upright, swayed, and fell back again. His face was pale. Sweat beaded his forehead. There was a knock at the door. Vimes opened it a fraction. It's me, sir. Fred Colon. I got a message. What's up? Ah, oh, Fred. Who have you got down there so far? There's me, and Constable Flint, and Constable Slapper, sir. Right. Someone's to go up to my place and get Willikins to bring me my street uniform, and my sword and crossbow, and an overnight bag, and some cigars. And tell Lady Sybil, uh, tell Lady Sybil, uh, well, they'll just have to tell Lady Sybil I've got to deal with things down here, that's all. What's happening, sir? Someone downstairs said Lord Vetinari's dead. Dead? murmured the patrician from his bed. Nonsense! He jerked himself upright, swung his legs off the bed, and folded up. It was a slow, terrible collapse. Lord Vetinari was a tall man, so there was a long way to fall, and he did it by folding up a joint at a time. His ankles gave way, and he fell on his knees. His knees hit the ground with a bang, and he bent at the waist. Finally, his forehead bounced on the carpet. Oh, he said. His lordship's just a bit, um... Vimes began, then he grabbed Colon and dragged him out of the room. I reckon he's been poisoned, Fred, and that's the truth of it. Colon looked horrified. Ye gods, do you want me to get a doctor? Are you mad? We want him to live. Vimes bit his lip. He'd said the words that were on his mind, and now, without a doubt, the faint smoke of rumour would drift out across the city. But someone ought to look at him, he said aloud. Damn right! said Colon. You want I should get a wizard? How do we know it wasn't one of them? Ye gods! Vimes tried to think. All the doctors in the city were employed by the guilds, and all the guilds hated Vetinari, so... When you've got enough people to spare a runner, send him up to the stables on King's Down to fetch Donut Jimmy, he said. Colon looked even more stricken. Donut? He doesn't know anything about doctoring. He dopes racehorses. Just get him, Fred. What if he won't come? 
Then say that Commander Vimes knows why Laughing Boy didn't win the Quirm Hundred Dollars last week, and say that I know Chryso praised the troll lost ten thousand on that race. Colon was impressed. You've got a nasty twist of mind there, sir. There's going to be a lot of people turning up pretty soon. I want a couple of watchmen outside this room, trolls or dwarfs for preference, and no one is to come in without my permission, right? Colon's face contorted as various emotions fought for space. Finally, he managed to say, But poisoned? He's got food tasters and everything. Then maybe it was one of them, Fred. My God, sir, you don't trust anyone, do you? No, Fred. Incidentally, was it you? Just kidding, Vimes added quickly, as Colon's face threatened to burst into tears. Off you go. We don't have much time. Vimes shut the door and leaned on it. Then he turned the key in the lock and moved a chair under the handle. Finally, he hauled the patrician off the floor and rolled him onto the bed. There was a grunt from the man, and his eyelids flickered. Poison, thought Vimes. That's the worst of all. It doesn't make a noise. The poisoner can be miles away. You can't see it. Often you can't really smell it or taste it. It could be anywhere. And there it is, doing its work. The patrician opened his eyes. I would like a glass of water, he said. There was a jug and glass by the bed. Vimes picked up the jug and hesitated. I'll send someone to get some, he said. Lord Vetinari blinked very slowly. Ah, Sir Samuel, he said. But whom can you trust? There was a crowd in the big audience chamber when Vimes finally went downstairs. They were milling about, worried and unsure, and like important men everywhere, when they were worried and unsure, they got angry. The first to bustle up to Vimes was Mr. Boggis of the Guild of Thieves. Yeah, what's going on, Vimes? he demanded. He met Vimes' stare. Sir Samuel, I mean, he said, losing a certain amount of bustle. I believe Lord Vetinari has been poisoned, said Vimes. The background muttering stopped. Boggis realised that, since he had been the one to ask the question, he was now the man on the spot. Uh, fatally, he said. In the silence, a pin would have clanged. Not yet, said Vimes. Around the hall there was a turning of heads. The focus of the universal attention was Dr. Downey, head of the Guild of Assassins. Downey nodded. I'm not aware of any arrangement with regard to Lord Vetinari, he said. Besides, as I am sure is common knowledge, we have set the price for the patrician at one million dollars. And who has that sort of money indeed, said Vimes. Well, you for one, Sir Samuel, said Downey. There was some nervous laughter. We uh, wish to see Lord Vetinari in any case, said Boggis. No. No? And why not, pray? Doctor's orders. Really? <laughs> Which doctor? Behind Vimes, Sergeant Colon shut his eyes. Dr. James Folsom, said Vimes. It took a few seconds before someone worked this out. What? You can't mean... Donut Jimmy? He's a horse doctor. So I understand, said Vimes. But why? Because many of his patients survive, said Vimes. He raised his hands as the protest screw. And now, gentlemen, I must leave you. Somewhere there's a poisoner. I'd like to find him before he becomes a murderer. He went back up the stairs, trying to ignore the shouts behind him. You sure about old Donut, sir? said Colon, catching him up. Well, do you trust him? said Vimes. Donut? Of course not. Right, he's untrustworthy, and so we don't trust him. So that's all right. But I've seen him revive a horse when everyone else said it was fit only for the knackers. Horse doctors have to get results, Fred. And that was true enough. When a human doctor, after much bleeding and cupping, finds that a patient has died out of sheer desperation, he can always say, Dear me, will of the gods, that'll be thirty dollars, please, and walk away a free man. This is because human beings are not technically worth anything. A good racehorse, on the other hand, may be worth twenty thousand dollars. A doctor who lets one hurry off too soon to that great big paddock in the sky may well expect to hear, out of some dark alley, a voice saying something on the lines of, Mr. Chrysoprace is very upset, and find the brief remainder of his life full of incident. No one seems to know where Captain Carrot and Angua are, said Colon. It's their day off, and Nobby's nowhere to be found. 
Well, that's something to be thankful for. Bingly, bingly, bong, beep, said a voice from Vimes's pocket. He lifted out the little organiser and raised the flap. Yes. Ah, uh, twelve noon, said the imp. Lunch with Lady Sybil. It stared at their faces. Eh, uh, eh, uh, that's all right, isn't it? It said. Cheery Little Bottom wiped his brow. Ah, oh, Commander Vimes is right. It could be arsenic, he said. It looks like arsenic poisoning to me. Look at his colour. <coughs> Nasty stuff, said Donut Jimmy. Has he been eating his bedding? All the sheets seem to be here, so I suppose the answer is no. How's he pissing? Uh, the usual way, I assume. Donut sucked at his teeth. He had amazing teeth. It was the second thing everyone noticed about him. They were the colour of the inside of an unwashed teapot. Yeah, walk him round a bit on the loose rein, he said. The patrician opened his eyes. You are a doctor, aren't you? he said. Donut Jimmy gave him an uncertain look. He was not used to patients who could talk. But, well, well, yeah, I've had a lot of patients, he said. Indeed. I have very little, said the patrician. He tried to lift himself off the bed and slumped back. But I'll, I'll mix up a draught, said Donut Jimmy, backing away. You ought to hold his nose and pour it down his throat twice a day, right? And, oh, and, and no oats. He hurried out, leaving Cheery alone with the patrician. Corporal Littlebottom looked around the room. Vimes hadn't given him much instruction. He'd said, I'm sure it won't be the food tasters. For all they know, they might be asked to eat the whole plateful. Still, we'll get detritus to talk to them. You find out the how, right, and then leave the who to me. If you didn't eat or drink a poison, what else was left? Probably you could put it on a pad and make someone breathe it, or dribble some in their ear while they slept, or they could touch it, maybe a small dart, or an insect bite. The patrician stirred and looked at Cheery through watery red eyes. Tell me, young man... Are you a policeman? Uh, just started, sir. You appear to be of the dwarf persuasion. Cheery didn't bother to answer. There was no use denying it. Somehow people could tell if you were a dwarf just by looking at you. Arsenic is a very popular poison, said the patrician. Hundreds of uses around the home. Crushed diamonds used to be in vogue for hundreds of years, despite the fact they never worked. Giant spiders, too, for some reason. Mercury is for those with patience. Aquafortis for those without. Cantharides has its followers. Much can be done with the secretions of various animals. The bodily fluids of the caterpillar of the quantum weather butterfly will render a man quite, quite helpless. But we return to arsenic like an old old friend. There was a drowsiness in the patrician's voice. Is that not so, young veterinary? Yes, indeed, sir. Correct. But where then shall we put it, seeing that all will look for it? In the last place they will look, sir. Wrong. Foolish. We put it where no one will look at all. The voice faded to a murmur. The bed linen, Cheery thought, even clothes, into the skin, slowly. Cheery hammered on the door. A guard opened it. Get another bed. What? Another bed from anywhere, and fresh bed linen. He looked down. There wasn't much of a carpet on the floor, even so in a bedroom where people might walk with bare feet. And take away this rug and bring another one. What else? Detritus came in, nodded at Cheery, and looked carefully around the room. Finally, he picked up a battered chair. This'll have to do, he said. If he want, he can break the back off it. What? said Cheery. Old Donut said for to get a stool sample, said Detritus, going out again. Cheery opened his mouth to stop the troll and then shrugged. Anyway, the less furniture in here, the better. And that seemed about it, short of stripping the wallpaper off the wall. Sam Vimes stared out of the window. Veterinari hadn't bothered much in the way of bodyguards. He had used, that is, he still did use, food tasters. But that was common enough. Mind you, Veterinari had added his own special twist. The tasters were well paid and treated, and they were all sons of the chief cook. 
but his main protection was that he was just that bit more useful alive than dead, from everyone's point of view. The big, powerful guilds didn't like him, but they liked him in power a lot more than they liked the idea of someone from a rival guild in the Oblong office. Besides, Lord Vetinari represented stability. It was a cold and clinical kind of stability, but part of his genius was the discovery that stability was what people wanted more than anything else. He'd said to Vimes once, in this very room, standing at this very window, they think they want good government and justice for all, Vimes, yet what is it they really crave deep in their hearts? Only that things go on as normal and tomorrow is pretty much like today. Now Vimes turned round. What's my next move, Fred? Dunno, sir. Vimes sat down in the patrician's chair. Can you remember the last patrician? Old Lord Snapkeys? And the one before him? Lord Winder? Oh, yeah. Nasty pieces of work they were. At least this one didn't giggle or wear a dress. The past tense, thought Vimes. It creeps in already. Not long past, but already very tense. It's gone very quiet downstairs, Fred, he said. Plotten don't make a lot of noise, sir, generally. Vetinari's not dead, Fred. Yes, sir, but he's not exactly in charge, is he? Vimes shrugged. No one's in charge, I suppose. Could be, sir. There again, you never know your luck. Colin was standing stiffly to attention, with his eyes firmly fixed on the middle distance and his voice pitched carefully to avoid any hint of emotion in the words. Vimes recognized the stance. He used it himself when he had to. What do you mean, Fred? he said. Not a thing, sir. Figure of speech, sir. Vimes sat back. This morning, he thought, I knew what the day held. I was going to see about that damn coat of arms. Then there was my usual meeting with Vetinari. I was going to read some reports after lunch. Maybe go and see how they're getting on with the new watch house in Chitling Street and have an early night. Now Fred's suggesting... What? Listen, Fred, if there is to be a new ruler, it won't be me. Who'll it be, sir? Colon's voice still held that slow, deliberate tone. How should I know? It could be... The gap opened ahead of him, and he could feel his thoughts being sucked into it. You're talking about Captain Carrot, aren't you, Fred? Could be, sir. I mean, none of the guilds would let some other guild bloke be ruler now, and everyone likes Captain Carrot, and, well, rumours got about that he's the heir to the throne, sir. There's no proof of that, Sergeant. Not for me to say, sir, don't know about that, don't know what is proof, said Colin, with just a hint of defiance. But he's got that sword of his, and the birthmark shaped like a crown, and, well, everybody knows he's king. It's his charisma. Charisma, thought Vimes. Oh, yes, Carrot has charisma. He makes something happen in people's heads. He can talk a charging leopard into giving up and handing over its teeth, and doing good work in the community, and that would really upset the old ladies. Vimes distrusted charisma. No more kings, Fred. Right you are, sir. By the way, Nobby's turned up. Oh, the day gets worse and worse, Fred. You said you talked to him about all these funerals, sir? The job goes on, I suppose. All right, go and tell him to come up here. Vimes was left to himself. No more kings. Vimes had difficulty in articulating why this should be so, why the concept revolted in his very bones. After all, a good many of the patricians had been as bad as any king, but they were sort of bad on equal terms. What set Vimes's teeth on edge was the idea that kings were a different kind of human being, a higher life form, somehow magical. But huh, there was some magic at that. Aunt Morpork still seemed to be littered with royal this and royal that, little old men who got paid a few pence a week to do a few meaningless chores, like the master of the king's keys, or the keeper of the crown jewels, even though there were no keys and certainly no jewels. Royalty was like dandelions. No matter how many heads you chopped off, the roots were still there underground waiting to spring up again. It seemed to be a chronic disease. It was as if even the most intelligent person had this little blank spot in their heads where someone had written, Kings! What a good idea! Whoever had created humanity had left in a major design flaw. It was its tendency to bend at the knees. 
there was a knock at the door. It should not be possible for a knock to sound surreptitious, yet this knock achieved it. It had harmonics. They told the hindbrain, the person knocking will, if no one eventually answers, open the door anyway, and sidle in, whereupon he will certainly nick any smokes that are lying around, read any correspondence that catches his eye, open a few drawers, take a nip out of such bottles of alcohol as are discovered, but to stop short of a major crime, because he is not criminal in the sense of making a moral decision, but in the sense that a weasel is evil. It is built into his very shape. It was a knock with a lot to say for itself. Come in, Nobby, said Vimes wearily. Corporal Nobbs sidled in, and it was another special trait of his that he could sidle forwards as well as sideways. He saluted awkwardly. There was something absolutely changeless about Corporal Nobbs, Vimes told himself. Even Fred Colon had adapted to the changing nature of the city watch, but nothing altered Corporal Nobbs in any way. It wouldn't matter what you did to him, there was always something fundamentally knobby about Corporal Nobbs. Nobby? Yes, sir? Uh, take a seat, Nobby. Corporal Nobbs looked suspicious. This was not how a dressing down was supposed to begin. Uh, Fred said you wanted to see me, Mr. Vines, uh, on account of timekeeping. Did I? Did I? Oh, yes. Nobby, how many grandmother's funerals have you really been to? Er, uh, three, said Nobby uncomfortably. Three? It turned out Nanny Nobbs weren't quite dead the first time. So why have you taken all this time off? Uh, don't like to say, sir. Why not? You're going to go spare, sir. Spare? You know, sir. Throw a wobbler. I might, Nobby, Vime sighed, but it'll be nothing to what'll get heaved if you don't tell me. Thing is, it's the, uh... The tricenter, the, uh, tricary, um, this three hundred year celebration thing next year, Mr. Vimes. Yes, Nobby licked his lips. I didn't like to ask for time off special. Fred said you were a bit sensitive about it all, but you know I'm in the peeled nuts, sir. Vimes nodded. Those clowns who dress up and pretend to fight old battles with blunt swords, he said. The Ankh Morpork Historical Recreation Society, sir, said Nobby, a shade reproachfully. That's what I said. Well, we're going to recreate the Battle of Ankh Morpork for the celebration, see? And that means extra practice. It all begins to make sense, said Vimes, nodding wearily. You've been marching up and down with your tin pike, eh? In my time... Uh, not exactly, Mr. Vimes. Uh, I've, I've been riding up and down on my white horse, to tell the truth. Ah, oh, playing at being general, eh? Yeah, bit more than a general, sir. Go on. Nobby's Adam's apple bobbed nervously. Eh, yeah. I'm going to be King Lorenzo, sir. Uh, you know, the last king, the one you, um, uh, the one you... The air froze. You are going to be, Vimes began, unpeeling each word like a sullen grape of wrath. I said you'd go spare, said Nobby. Fred Colon said you'd go spare too. Why are you... We drew lots, sir. And you lost, Nobby squirmed. Eh, not exactly lost, sir, not precisely lost. Eh, more sort of, uh, won, sir. Everyone wanted to play him, I mean... You get a horse and a good costume and everything, sir. And he was a king, off when all said and done, sir. The man was a vicious monster. Well, he was all a long time ago, sir, said Nobby anxiously. Vimes calmed down a little. And who drew the straw to play stone-faced Vimes? And, uh, and, well, Nobby. Nobby hung his head. And, no one, sir. No one wanted to play him, sir. The little corporal swallowed, and then plunged onwards with the air of a man determined to get it all over with. So we're, um, we're making a man out of straw, sir, so he'll burn nicely when we throw him on the bonfire in the evening. There's going to be fireworks, sir, he added with dreadful certainty. Viams's face shut down. Nobby preferred it when people shouted. He had been shouted at for most of his life. He could handle shouting.
no one wanted to be Stoneface Vimes, Vimes said coldly. On account of him being on the losing side, sir. Losing? Vimes' his iron heads won. He ruled the city for six months. Nobby squirmed again. Yeah, but everyone in the society says he didn't ought to have, sir. They said it was just a fluke, sir. After all, he was outnumbered ten to one, and he had warts, sir. And he was a bit of a bastard, sir, when all said and done. He did chop off a king's head, sir. You've got to be a bit of a nasty type to do that, sir. Saving your presence, Mr. Vimes. Vimes shook his head. What did it matter anyway? But it did matter somewhere. It had all been a long time ago. It didn't matter what a bunch of deranged romantics thought. Facts were facts. All right, I understand, he said. It's almost funny, really. Because there's something else I've got to tell you, Nobby. Yes, sir, said Nobby, looking relieved. Do you remember your father? Nobby looked about to panic again. What kind of a question is that to suddenly ask anybody, sir? Purely a social inquiry. Old Sconner, sir? <laughs> Not much, sir. I never used to see him much, except when the military police used to come for to drag him out of the attic. <laughs> Do you know much about your uh, antecedents? That is a lie, sir. I haven't got no antecedents, sir, no matter what you might have been told. Oh, good. Uh, you don't actually know what antecedents means, do you, Nobby? Nobby shifted uneasily. He didn't like being questioned by policemen, especially since he was one. Um, not in so many words, sir. You never got told anything about your forebears? Another worried expression crossed Nobby's face, so Vimes quickly added, Your ancestors... Only old Sconner, sir. Sir, if all this is working up to asking about them sacks of vegetables which went missing from the shop in Treacle Mine Road, I was not anywhere near the... Vimes waved a hand vaguely. He didn't leave you anything or anything? A couple of scars, sir, and this trick elbow of mine... It aches sometimes when the weather changes. I always remember old Sconner when the wind blows from the hub. Ah, right. And this, of course, Nobby fished around behind his rusting breastplate. And that was a marvel, too. Even Sergeant Colan's armour could shine, if not actually gleam. But any metal anywhere near Nobby's skin corroded very quickly. The corporal pulled out a leather thong that hung around his neck. There was a gold ring on it. Despite the fact that gold cannot corrode, it had nevertheless developed a patina. He left it to me when he was on his deathbed, said Nobby. Well, when I say left it, uh, did he say anything? Well, yeah, he did say, give it back, you little bugger, sir. See, he had it on a string round his neck, sir, just like me. But it's not like a proper ring, sir. I'd have flogged it, but it's all I've got to remember him by, except when the wind blows from the hub. Vimes took the ring and rubbed it with a finger. It was a seal ring with a coat of arms on it. Age and wear and the immediate presence of the body of Corporal Nobbs had made it quite unreadable. You are armigerous, Nobby. Nobby nodded. But I got a special shampoo for it, sir. Vimes sighed. He was an honest man. He'd always felt that was one of the biggest defects in his personality. When you've got a moment, nip along to the College of Heralds in Molly Mog Street, will you? Take this ring with you. And say I sent you? Eh, it's all right, Nobby, said Vimes. You won't get into trouble. Not as such. If you say so, sir. And you don't have to bother with the sir, Nobby. Yes, sir. When Nobby had gone, Vimes reached behind the desk and picked up a faded copy of Twerp's Peerage, or as he personally thought of it, the Guide to the Criminal Classes. You wouldn't find slum dwellers in these pages, but you would find their landlords. And while it was regarded as pretty good evidence of criminality to be living in a slum, for some reason owning a whole street of them merely got you invited to the very best social occasions. These days they seemed to be bringing out a new edition every week. Dragon had been right about one thing at least. Everyone in Ark Borpork seemed to be hankering after more arms than they were born with. He looked up de Nobbs.
There even was a damn coat of arms. One supporter of the shield was a hippo, presumably one of the royal hippos of Ark Morpork, and therefore the ancestor of Roderick and Keith. The other was a bull of some sort, with a very knobby-like expression. It was holding a golden ark, which this being the Dunobas coat of arms, it had probably stolen from somewhere. The shield was red and green. There was a white chevron with five apples on it. Quite what they had to do with warfare was unclear. Perhaps they were some kind of jolly visual pun, or play on words that had had them slapping their thighs down at the Royal College of Arms, although probably if Dragon slapped his thigh too hard his leg would fall off. It was easy enough to imagine an ennobled Nobs, because where Nobby went wrong was in thinking small. He sidled into places and pinched things that weren't worth much. If only he'd sidled into continents and stolen entire cities, slaughtering many of the inhabitants in the process, he'd have been a pillar of the community. There was nothing in the book under Vimes. Suffer not injustice, Vimes wasn't a pillar of the community. He killed a king with his own hands. It needed doing, but the community, whatever that was, didn't always like the people who did what needed to be done or said what had to be said. He put some other people to death as well, that was true, but the city had been lousy. There'd been a lot of stupid wars. We were practically part of the Clatchian Empire. Sometimes you needed a bastard. History had wanted surgery. Sometimes Dr. Chopper is the only surgeon to hand. There's something final about an axe. But kill one wretched king, and everyone calls you a regicide. It wasn't as if it was a habit or anything. Vimes had found old Stoneface's journal in the Unseen University Library. The man had been hard, no doubt about that. But they were hard times. He'd written, In the fires of struggle, let us bake new men who will notty heed the old lies. But the old lies had won in the end. He said to people, You're free! And they said, Hooray! And then he showed them what freedom costs, and they called him a tyrant. And as soon as he'd been betrayed, they milled around a bit like barn-bred chickens who've seen the big world outside for the first time, and then they went back into the warm and shut the door. Bing bong, bingly beep. Vimes sighed and pulled out his organizer. Yes. Memo, appointment with bootmaker, two p.m. Said the imp. It's not two o'clock yet, and that was Tuesday in any case. Said Vimes. So I'll cross it off the list of things to do then. Vimes put the disorganized organizer back in his pocket and went and looked out of the window again. Who had a motive for poisoning Lord Vetinari? No, that wasn't the way to crack it. Probably, if you went to some outlying area of the city and confined your investigations to little old ladies who didn't get out much, what with all the wallpaper over the door and everything, you might be able to find someone without a motive. But the man stayed alive by always arranging matters so that a future without him represented a riskier business than a future with him still upright. The only people, therefore, who'd risk killing him were madmen. And the gods knew Ankh Morpork had enough of them, or someone who was absolutely confident that if the city collapsed, he'd be standing on top of the pile. If Fred were right, and the sergeant was generally a good indicator of how the man in the street thought, because he was the man in the street, then that person was Captain Carrot. But Carrot was one of the few people in the city who seemed to like Vetinari. Of course, there was one other person who stood to gain. Damn, thought Vimes. It's me, isn't it? There was another knock at the door. He didn't recognize this one. He opened the door cautiously. It's me, sir, Little Bottom. Come in, then. It was nice to know there was at least one person in the world with more problems than him. How is his lordship? Stable, said Little Bottom. Dead is stable, said Vimes. I mean, he's alive, sir, and sitting up reading. Mr. Donut made up some sticky stuff that tasted of seaweed, sir, and I mixed up some glueball salts. Sir, you know the old man in the house on the bridge? What old? Oh, yes. It seemed a long time ago. What about him? Well, you asked me to look round, and I took some pictures. This is one, sir. He handed Vimes a rectangle that was nearly all black. Odd. Where do you get it? Er,、uh, have you ever heard the story about dead men's eyes, sir? Assume I haven't had a literary education, Little Bottom. Well, they say who say? They say, sir. You know they. The same people who are everyone and everyone knows. 
The people who live in the community? Yes, sir. I suppose so, sir. Vimes waved a hand. Oh, them. Well, go on. They say that the last thing a dying man sees stays imprinted in his eyes, sir. Oh, that. That's just an old story. Yes, amazing, really. I mean, if it weren't true, you'd have thought it wouldn't have survived, wouldn't you? I thought I saw this little red spark, so I got the imp to paint a really big picture before it faded completely. And right in the centre... Couldn't the imp have made it up, said Vimes, staring at the picture again. They haven't got the imagination to lie, sir. What they see is what you get. Glowing eyes. Two red dots, said Littlebottom, conscientiously, which might indeed be a pair of glowing eyes, sir. Good point, Littlebottom, Vimes rubbed his chin. Blast! I just hope it's not a god of some sort. That's all I need at a time like this. Can you make copies so I can send them to all the watch houses? Yes, sir. The imp's got a good memory. Hop to it, then. But before Littlebottom could go, the door opened again. Vimes looked up. Carrot and Angua were there. Carrot, I thought you were on your day off. We found a murder, sir, at the Dwarf Bread Museum, but when we got back to the watch house, they told us Lord Bettinari's dead. Did they? thought Vimes. That's rumour for you. If we could modulate it with truth, how useful it could be. He's breathing well for a corpse, he said. I think he'll be OK. Someone got past his guard, that's all. I've got a doctor to see him, don't worry. Someone got past his guard, he thought. Yes, and I'm his guard. I hope the man's a leader in the field, that's all I can say, said Carrot severely. He's even better than that, he's the doctor to the leaders of the field, said Vimes. I'm his guard, and I didn't see it coming. It'd be terrible for the city if anything happened to him, said Carrot. Vimes saw nothing but innocent concern behind Carrot's forthright stare. It would, wouldn't it, he said. Anyway, it's under control. You said there's been another murder. At the Dwarf Bread Museum, someone killed Mr. Hopkinson with his own bread. Made him eat it? Hit him with it, sir, said Carrot reproachfully. Battle bread, sir. Is he the old man with the white beard? Yes, sir. You remember, I introduced you to him when I took you to see the Boomerang Biscuit Exhibition. Angua thought she saw a faint wince of recollection speed guiltily across Vimes's face. Who's going around killing old men? he said to the world at large. Don't know, sir. Constable Angua went plain clothes. Carrot waggled his eyebrows conspiratorially and couldn't find a sniff of anyone. And nothing was taken. This is what it was done with. The battle bread was much larger than an ordinary loaf. Vimes turned it over gingerly. Dwarfs throw it like a discus, right? Yes, sir. At the Seven Mountains Games last year, Snorri Shieldbiter took the tops off a line of six hard-boiled eggs at fifty yards, sir. And that was with just a standard hunting loaf. But this is, well, it's a cultural artifact. We haven't got the baking technology for bread like this anymore. It's unique. Valuable? Very, sir. Worth stealing? You'd never be able to get rid of it. Every honest dwarf would recognise it. Hmm. Did you hear about that priest being murdered on Misbegot Bridge? Carrot looked shocked. Not old Father Tubal, Jack. Really? Vimes stopped himself from asking, You know him, then? Because Carrot knew everyone. If Carrot were to be dropped into some dense tropical jungle, it'd be, Hello, Mr. Run Swiftly Through the Trees. Good morning, Mr. Talks to the Forest. What a splendid blowpipe. And what a novel place for a feather. Did he have more than one enemy? said Vimes. Sorry, sir? Why more than one? I should say the fact that he had one is obvious, wouldn't you? He is... he was a nice old chap, said Carrot. Hardly stirred out. Spends... spent all his time with his books. Very religious. I mean, all kinds of religion. Studied them. Bit odd, but no harm in him. Why should anyone want to kill him? Or Mr. Hopkinson, a pair of harmless old men. Vimes handed him the battle bread. We shall find out. Constable Angua, I want you to have a look at this one. Take, yes, take Corporal Littlebottom, he said. He's been doing some work on it. Angua's from Uberwald too, Littlebottom. Maybe you've got friends in common, that sort of thing. Carrot nodded cheerfully. Angua's expression went wooden. 
Ha, her drek guard the watch shirt at us, said Carrot. Ha, ha, Angua, the constable, Angua, Kahar, Bahak, Bahar, Shid, Kar, Kadak. Welcome, Corporal Smallbottom. This is Constable Angua. Angua, show Smallbottom how well you're learning dwarfish. Angua appeared to concentrate. Grrrduk, the booze grrrak, she managed. Carrot laughed. You just said small, delightful mining tool of a feminine nature. Cheery stared at Angua, who returned the stare blankly while mumbling, Well, dwarfish is difficult if you haven't eaten gravel all your life. Cheery was still staring. Er, uh, thank you, he managed. Er, uh, I'd better go and tidy up. What about Lord Vetinari? said Carrot. I'm putting my best man on that, said Vimes. Trustworthy, reliable, knows the ins and outs of this place like the back of his hand. I'm handling it, in other words. Carrot's hopeful expression faded to hurt puzzlement. Don't you want me to? he said. I could... No. Indulge an old man. I want you to go back to the watch house and take care of things. What things? Everything. Rise to the occasion. Move paper around. Does that new shift rotor to draw up? Shout at people. Read reports. Carrot saluted. Yes, Commander Vimes. Good. Off you go, then. And if anything happens to Vetinari, Vimes added to himself as the dejected Carrot went out, no one will be able to say you were anywhere near him. The little grill in the gate of the Royal College of Arms snapped open to the distant accompaniment of brayings and grunts. Yes, said a voice. What dost thee want? I'm Corporal Nobbs, said Nobby. An eye applied itself to the grill. It took in the full dreadful extent of the godly handiwork that was Corporal Nobbs. Are you, eh, uh, the baboon? We've had one on order for... No, I've come about some coat with arms, said Nobby. You, said the voice. The owner of the voice made it very clear that he was aware there were degrees of nobility from something above kingship, stretching all the way down to commoner, and that as far as Corporal Nobbs was concerned, an entirely new category, communist, perhaps, would have to be coined. I've been told, said Nobby miserably, it's about this ring I got. Go round the back door, said the voice. Cheery was tidying away the makeshift equipment he'd set up in the privy when a sound made him look round. Angua was leaning against the doorway. What do you want? he demanded. Nothing. I just thought I'd say don't worry. I won't tell anyone if you don't want me to. I don't know what you're talking about. I think you're lying. Cheery dropped a test tube and sagged onto a seat. How could you tell? he said. Even other dwarfs can't tell. I've been so careful. Shall we just say, I have special talents, said Angua. Cheery started to clean a beaker distractedly. I don't know why you're so upset, said Angua. I thought dwarfs hardly recognized the difference between male and female anyway. Half the dwarfs we bring in here under number 23 are female, I know that, and they're the ones that are hardest to subdue. What's a number 23? Running, screaming at people while drunk and trying to cut their knees off, said Angua. It's easier to give them numbers than write it down every time. Look, there's plenty of women in this town that'd love to do things the dwarf way. I mean, what are the choices they've got? Barmaid, seamstress, or someone's wife? Well, you can do anything the men do. Provided we do only what the men do, said Cheery. Angua paused. No, oh, she said, I see. Uh, yes, I know that tune. I can't hold an axe, said Cheery. I'm scared of fights. I think songs about gold are stupid. I hate beer. I can't even drink dwarfishly. When I try to quaff, I drown the dwarf behind me. I can see that could be tricky, said Angua. I saw a girl walk down the street here and some men whistled after her. And you can wear dresses with colours. Oh, dear. Angua tried not to smile. How long have lady dwarfs felt like this? I thought they were happy with the way things are. Oh, it's easy to be happy when you don't know any different, said Cheery, bitterly. Chain mail trousers are fine, if you've never heard of lingerie. Lingerie? Oh, yes, said Angua. Lingerie, yes. 
She tried to feel sympathetic and found that she was, really, but she did have to stop herself from saying that at least you don't have to find styles that can easily be undone by pause. I thought I could come here and get a different kind of job, Cheery moaned. I'm good at needlework, and I went to see the Guild of Seamstresses, and... She stopped and blushed behind her beard. Yes, said Angua, lots of people make that mistake. She stood up straight and brushed herself off. You've impressed Commander Vimes anyway. I think you'll like it here. Everyone's got troubles in the watch. Normal people don't become policemen. You'll get on fine. Commander Vimes is a bit... Cheery began. He's okay when he's in a good mood. He needs to drink, but he doesn't dare to these days. You know, one drink is too many, two is not enough. And that makes him edgy. When he's in a bad mood, he'll tread on your toes and then shout at you for not standing up straight. You're normal, said Cheery, shyly. I like you. Angua patted her on the head. You say that now, she said, but when you've been around here for a while, you'll find out that sometimes I can be a bitch. What's that? What? That painting with the eyes. Or two points of red light, said Cheery. Oh, yeah? It's the last thing Father Tubalcheck saw, I think, said the dwarf. Angua stared at the black rectangle. She sniffed. There it is again. Cheery took a step backwards. What? What? Where's that smell coming from? Angua demanded. Not me, said Cherry hurriedly. Angua grabbed a small dish from the bench and sniffed at it. This is it? I smelled this at the museum. What is it? It's just clay. It was on the floor in the room where the old priest was killed, said Cherry. Probably it came off someone's boot. Angua crumbled some of it between her fingers. I think it's just potter's clay said Cheery. We used to use it at the guild for making pots, she added, just in case Angua hadn't grasped things. You know, crucibles and things. This looks like someone tried baking it but didn't get the heat right. See how it crumbles? Pottery, said Angua. I know a potter. She glanced down at the dwarf's iconograph again. Please, no, she thought. Not one of them. The front gate of the College of Arms, both front gates, were swung open. The two heralds bobbed excitedly around Corporal Nobbs as he tottered out. Has your lordship got everything he requires? <laughs> said Nobby. If we can be of any help whatsoever. <laughs> any help at all? Mm. Sorry about your boots, my lord, but the wyvern's been ill. It'll brush off no trouble when it dries. Nobby tottered off along the lane. He even walks nobly, wouldn't you say? More nobly than nobly, I think. It's disgusting that he's a mere corporal, a man of his breeding. Igneous the troll backed away until he was up against his potter's wheel. I never done it, he said. Done what? said Angua. Igneous hesitated. Igneous was huge and, well, rocky. He moved around the streets of Ark Morpork like a small iceberg, and, like an iceberg, there was more to him than immediately met the eye. He was known as a supplier of things, more or less any kind of things, and he was also a wall, which was the same as a fence, only a lot harder and tougher to beat. Igneous never asked unnecessary questions, because he couldn't think of any. Nothing, he said finally. Igneous had always found the general denial was more reliable than the specific refutation. Glad to hear it, said Angua. Now, where'd you get your clay from? Igneous's face crinkled as he tried to work out where this line of questioning could possibly go. I got receipts, he said. Every bit properly paid for. Angua nodded. It was probably true. Igneous, despite giving the appearance of not being able to count beyond ten without ripping off someone else's arm, and having an intimate involvement in the city's complex hierarchy of crime, was known to pay his bills. If you were going to be successful in the criminal world, you needed a reputation for honesty. Have you seen any like this before? she said, holding out the sample. Uh, it's clay, said Igneous, relaxing a little. I see clay all the time. It don't have no serial number. Clay's clay. Got lumps of it out the back. You make bricks and pots and stuff out of it. 
There's lots of potters in this town, and we all got the stuff. Why you want to know about clay? Can't you tell where it came from? Igneous took the tiny piece, sniffed it, and rolled it between his fingers. This is crank, he said, looking a lot happier now that the conversation was veering away from more personal concerns. That's like crappy clay, just good enough for them lady potters with dangly earrings what make coffee mugs but you can't lift with both hands. He rolled it again. Also, it got a lot of grog in it. That splits the old pots, all smashed up real small, makes it stronger. Any potter got loads of stuff like this. He rubbed it again. This has been sort of heated up, but it ain't properly baked. But you can't say where it came from? Out of the ground is the best I can do, lady, said Ignis. He relaxed a little now. It appeared that inquirers were not to do with such matters as a recent batch of hollow statues and subjects of a similar nature. As sometimes happened in these circumstances, he tried to be helpful. Come and have a look at this. He loped away. The watchmen followed him through the warehouse, observed by a couple of dozen cautious trolls. No one liked to see policemen up close, especially if the reason you were working at Igneous's place was that it was nice and quiet and you wanted somewhere to lie low for a few weeks. Besides, while it was true that a lot of people came to Ankh-Morpork because it was a city of opportunity, sometimes it was the opportunity not to be hung, skewered, or dismantled for whatever crimes you'd left behind in the mountains. Just don't look, said Angua. Why? said Cherry. Because there's just us, and there's at least two dozen of them, said Angua, and all our clothes were made for people with full sets of arms and legs. Igneous went through a doorway and out into the yard behind the factory. Pots were stacked high on pallets, bricks were curing in long rows, and under a crude roof were several large mounds of clay. Eh, <laughs> said Igneous generously. Clay. Is there a special name for it when it's piled up like that? said Cherry timorously. She prodded the stuff. Yeah, said Igneous. That's technically what we calls a heap. Angua shook her head sadly. So much for clues. Clay was clay. She'd hoped they were all different sorts, and it turned out to be as common as dirt. And then Igneous helped the police with their inquiries. Do you mind if you goes out the back way? He mumbled. Yous make the people nervous, and I get pots I can't sell. He indicated a pair of wide doors in the rear wall, big enough for a cart to get through. Then he fumbled in his apron and produced a large key ring. The padlock on the gate was big and shiny and new. You were afraid of theft, said Angua. No, lady, that's unfair, said Igneous. Someone broke the old lock when they pinched some stuff three, four months ago. Disgusting, isn't it, said Angua. Makes you wonder why you pay your taxes, I expect. In some ways, Igneous was a lot brighter than, say, Mr. Ironcrust. He ignored the remark. It was just stuff, he said, ushering them towards the open gate as speedily as he dared. Was it clay they stole? said Cheery. It don't cost much, but it's the principle of the thing, he said. It beat me why they bothered. It come to something when half a ton of clay can just walk out the door. Angua looked at the lock again. Yes, indeed, she said distantly. The gate rattled shut behind them. They were outside in an alley. Fancy anyone stealing a load of clay, said Cheery. Did he tell the watch? I shouldn't think so, said Angua. Wasps don't complain too loudly when they're stung. Anyway, Detritus thinks Igneous is mixed up with smuggling slab to the mountains, and so he's itching for an excuse to have a poke around it here. Look, this is still technically my day off. She stepped back and peered up at the high spiked wall around the yard. Could you bake clay in a baker's oven? she said. Oh, no. Doesn't get hot enough. No, it's the wrong shape. Some of your pots would be baked hard, while others would still be green. Why'd you ask? Why did I ask? Angua thought. Oh, what the hell? Fancy a drink? Not ale, said Cheery quickly, and nowhere where you have to sing while you drink, or slap your knees. Angua nodded understandingly. Somewhere, in fact, without dwarfs? Ah, uh, yes. Where we're going, said Angua, that won't be a problem. The fog was rising fast. 
All morning it had hung around in alleys and cellars. Now it was moving back in for the night. It came out of the ground and up from the river and down from the sky, a clinging, yellowish, stinging blanket, the river ark in droplet form. It found its way through cracks and, against all common sense, managed to survive in lighted rooms, filling the air with an eye-watering haze and making the candles crackle. Outdoors, every figure loomed, every shape was a menace. In a drab alley off a drab street, Angua stopped, squared her shoulders and pushed open a door. The atmosphere in the long, low, dark room altered as she stepped inside. A moment of time rang like a glass bowl, and then there was a sense of relaxation. People turned back in their seats. Well, they were seated. It was quite likely they were people. Cheery moved closer to Angua. What's this place called? she whispered. It hasn't really got a name, said Angua, but sometimes we call it Beus. He didn't look like an inn outside. How did you find it? You don't. You gravitate to it. Cheery looked around nervously. She wasn't sure where they were, apart from somewhere in the cattle market district, somewhere up a maze of alleys. Angua walked to the bar. A deeper shadow appeared out of the gloom. Hello, Angua, it said in a deep rolling voice. Fruit juice, is it? Yes, chilled. And what about the dwarf? She'll have him raw, said a voice somewhere in the gloom. There was a ripple of laughter in the dark. Some of it sounded altogether too strange to Cheery. She couldn't imagine it issuing from normal lips. I'll have a fruit juice too, she quavered. Angua glanced at the dwarf. She felt oddly grateful that the remark from the darkness seemed to have gone entirely over the small bullet head. She unhooked her badge and with care and deliberation laid it down on the counter. It went palink. Then Angua leaned forward and showed the iconograph to the barman. If it was a man. Cheery wasn't sure yet. A sign over the bar said, Don't you ever change. You know everything that's going on, Igor, Angua said. Two old men got killed yesterday, and a load of clay got stolen from Igneous the Troll recently. Did you ever hear about that? What's that to you? Killing old men is against the law, said Angua. Of course, a lot of things are against the law, so we're very busy in the watch. We like to be busy about important things, otherwise we have to be busy about unimportant things. Are you hearing me? The shadow considered this. Go and take a seat, it said. I'll bring your drinks. Angua led the way to a table in an alcove. The clientele lost interest in them. A buzz of conversation resumed. What is this place? Cheery whispered. It's a place where people can be themselves, said Angua slowly. People who have to be a little bit careful at other times, you know? No. Angua sighed. Vampires, zombies, bogeymen, ghouls, oh my, the under... She corrected herself. The differently alive, she said. People who have to spend most of their time being very careful, not frightening people. Fitting in. That's how it works here. Fit in, get a job, don't worry people, and you probably won't find a crowd outside with pitchforks and flaming torches, but sometimes it's good to go where everybody knows your shape. Now that Cheery's eyes had grown accustomed to the low light, she could make out the variety of shapes on the benches. Some of them were a lot bigger than human. Some had pointy ears and long muzzles. Who's that girl? she said. She looks normal. That's Violet. She's a tooth fairy, and next to her is Schleppel, the bogeyman. In the far corner, something sat huddled in a huge overcoat under a high, broad, brimmed, pointed hat. And him? That's old man Trouble, said Angua. If you know what's good for you, you don't mind him. Er, uh, any werewolves here? One or two, said Angua. I hate werewolves. Oh? The oddest customer was sitting by herself at a small round table. She appeared to be a very old lady in a shawl and a straw hat with flowers in it. She was staring in front of her with an expression of good-natured aimlessness, and in context looked more frightening than any of the shadowy figures. What is she? Cheery hissed. Her? Oh, that's Mrs. Gamage. And what does she do? Do? Well, she comes in here most days for a drink and some company. Sometimes we... they... Have a sing-song, old songs, that she remembers. She's practically blind. If you mean, is she an undead, no, she isn't. Not a vampire, werewolf, zombie, or a bogeyman. Just an old lady. 
A huge, shambling, hairy thing paused at Mrs. Gamage's table and put a glass in front of her. Port and lemon, there you goes, Mrs. Gamage, it rumbled. Cheers, Charlie, the old lady cackled. How's the plumbing business? Doing fine, love, said the bogeyman and vanished into the gloom. That was a plumber, said Cheery. Of course not. I don't know who Charlie was. He probably died years ago, but she thinks the bogeyman is him, and who's going to tell her different? You mean she doesn't know this place is... Look, she's been coming here ever since the old days when it was the Crown and Dax, said Angua. No one wants to spoil things. Everyone likes Mrs. Gamage. They watch out for her, help her in little ways. How? Well, I heard that last month someone broke into her hovel and stole some of her stuff. That doesn't sound helpful. And it was all returned next day, and a couple of thieves were found in the shades with not a drop of blood left in their bodies. Angua smiled, and her voice took on a mocking edge. You know, you get told a lot of bad things about the undead, but you never hear about the marvellous work they do in the community. Igor the barman appeared. He looked more or less human, apart from the hair on the back of his hands and the single, unbifurcated eyebrow across his forehead. He tossed a couple of mats on the table and put their drinks down. You're probably wishing this was a dwarf bar, said Angua. She lifted her beer mat carefully and glanced at the underside. Cheery looked around again. By now, if it had been a dwarf bar, the floor would be sticky with beer, the air would be full of flying quaff, and people would be singing. They'd probably be singing the latest dwarf tune, Gold, 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 or one of the old favourites like Gold, 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 or the all-time biggie, Gold, Gold, Gold. In a few minutes, the first axe would have been thrown. No, she said, it could never be that bad. Drink up, said Angua. We've got to go and see, uh, something. A large, hairy hand grabbed Angua's wrist. She looked up into a terrifying face, all eyes and mouth and hair. Hello, Schlitzen, she said calmly. Ah, I'm hearing where there's a baron who's really unhappy about you, said Schlitzen, alcohol crystallizing on his breath. That's my business, Schlitzen, said Angua. Why don't you just go back behind your door like the good bogeyman that you are? Ah, he's saying where you're disgrace in the old country. Let go, please, said Angua. Her skin was white where Schlitzen was gripping her. Cheery looked from the wrist to the bogeyman's shoulder. Rangy though the creature was, muscles were strung along his arm like beads on a wire. Ah, you're wearing a badge, it sneered. What's a good we? Angua moved so fast, she was a blur. Her free hand pulled something from her belt and flipped it up and onto Schlitzen's head. He stopped and stood, swaying back and forth gently, making faint moaning sounds. On his head, flopping down around his ears like the knotted hanky of a style-impaired seaside sunbather, was a small square of heavy material. Angua pushed back her chair and grabbed the beer mat. The shadowy figures around the walls were muttering. Let's get out of here, she said. Igor, give us half a minute and then you can take the blanket off him. Come on. They hurried out. The fog had already turned the sun into a mere suggestion, but it was vivid daylight compared to the gloom in Beers. What happened to him? said Cheery, running to keep up with Angua's stride. Existential uncertainty, Angua said. He doesn't know whether he exists or not. It's cruel, I know, but it's the only thing we found that works against bogeymen. Blue, fluffy blanket for preference, she noted Cheery's blank expression. Look, bogeymen go away if you put your head under the blankets. Everyone knows that, don't they? So if you put their head under a blanket... Oh, I see. Oh, that's nasty. He'll feel all right in ten minutes. Angua skimmed the beer mat across the alley. What was he saying about a baron? I wasn't really listening, said Angua carefully. Cheery shivered in the fog, but not just from the cold. He sounded like he came from Uberwald, like us. There was a baron who lived near us, and he hated people to leave. Yes, the whole family were werewolves. One of them ate my second cousin. Angua's memory spun in a hurry. Old meals came back to haunt her from the time before she'd said, No, this is not the way to live. A dwarf, a dwarf. No, she was pretty sure she'd never... The family had always made fun of her eating habits. That's why I can't stand them, said Cheery. Oh, people say they can be tamed, but I say, once a wolf, always a wolf. You can't trust them. They're basically evil, aren't they? They could go back to the wild at any moment, I say. Yes, you may be right, 
And the worst thing is, most of the time they walk around looking just like real people. Angua blinked, glad of the twin disguises of the fog and Cheery's unquestioning confidence. Come on, we're nearly there. Where? We're going to see someone who's either our murderer or who knows who the murderer is. Cheery stopped. But you've got only a sword and I haven't even got that. Don't worry, we won't need weapons. Oh, good. They wouldn't be any use. Uh, oh. Vimes opened his door to see what all the shouting was about down in the office. The corporal manning, or in this case dwarfing, the desk was having trouble. Again? How many times have you been killed this week? I was minding my own business, said the unseen complainer. Stacking garlic? You're a vampire, aren't you? I mean, let's see what jobs you've been doing. Post sharpener for a fencing firm? Sunglasses tester for Argus opticians? Is it me, or is there some underlying trend here? Excuse me, Commander Vimes? Vimes looked round into a smiling face that sought only to do good in the world, even if the world had other things it wanted done. Ah, oh, constable visit. Yes, he said hurriedly. At the moment, I'm afraid I'm rather busy, and I'm not even sure that I've got an immortal soul. <laughs> so, perhaps you could call again when... It's about those words you asked me to check, said Visit reproachfully. What words? The ones Father Tubalcheck wrote in his own blood. You said to try and find out what they meant. Oh, yes, come into my office. Vimes relaxed. This wasn't going to be another one of those painful conversations about the state of his soul and the necessity of giving it a wash and brush up before eternal damnation set in. This was going to be about something important. It's ancient Cenotine, sir. It's out of one of their holy books, although, of course, when I say holy, it is a fact that they were basically misguided in a... Yes, yes, I'm sure, said Vimes, sitting down. Does it by any chance say Mr. X did it? Rah, rah, rah. No, sir, that phrase does not appear anywhere in any known holy book, sir. Ah, said Vimes. Besides, I looked at other documents in the room, and the paper does not appear to be in the deceased's handwriting, sir. Vimes brightened up. Aha! Someone else's. Does it say something like, Take that, you bastard, we've been waiting ages to get you for what you did all those years ago? No, sir, that phrase also does not appear in any holy book anywhere, said Constable Visit, and hesitated. Except in the Apocrypha to the Vengeful Testament of Ofla, he added conscientiously. These words are from the Cenotine Book of Truth, he sniffed, as they called it. It's what their false god. Could I just perhaps have the words and leave out the comparative religion, said Vimes. Very well, sir. Visit looked hurt, but unfolded a piece of paper and sniffed disparagingly. These are some of the rules that their god allegedly gave to the first people after he'd baked them out of clay, sir. Rules like, thou shalt labour fruitfully all the days of your life, sir, and thou shalt not kill, and thou shalt be humble, that sort of thing. Is that all? said Vimes. Yes, sir, said Visit. They're just religious quotations. Yes, sir. Any idea why it was in his mouth? Poor devil looked like he was having a last cigarette. No, sir. I could understand it if it was one of the smite your enemies ones, said Vimes. But that's just saying, get on with your work and don't make trouble. Sino was rather a liberal god, sir, not big on commandments. Sounds almost decent as gods go. Visit looks disapproving. The Cenotines died through five hundred years of waging some of the bloodiest wars on the continent, sir. Spare the thunderbolt and spoil the congregation, eh? said Vimes. Pardon, sir? Oh, nothing. Well, thank you, Constable. I'll uh, see that Captain Carrot is informed, and uh, thank you once again. Don't let me keep you from... Vimes's desperately accelerating voice was too late to prevent Visit pulling a roll of paper out of his breastplate. I brought you the latest unadorned facts magazine, sir, and also this month's battle call, which contains many articles that I'm sure will be of interest to you, including Pastor Nasal Peddler's exhortation to the congregation to rise up and speak to people sincerely through their letterboxes, sir. Er, uh, thank you. I can't help noticing that the pamphlets and magazines I gave you last week are still on your desk. Where I left them, sir? Oh, yes, well, sorry, you know how it is. The amount of work these days makes it so hard to find the time to... It's never too soon to contemplate eternal damnation, sir. I think about it all the time, Constable. Thank you. Unfair, thought Vimes, when visit had gone. A note is left at the scene of a crime in my town, and does it have the decency to be a death threat? 
No. The last dying scrawl of a man determined to name his murderer? No. It's a bit of religious doggerel. What's the good of clues that are more mysterious than the mystery? He scribbled a note on Visit's translation and chucked it into his in-tray. Too late, Angua remembered why she avoided the slaughterhouse district at this time of the month. She could change at will at any time, that's what people forgot about werewolves, but they remembered the important thing. Full moonlight was the irresistible trigger. The lunar rays reached down into the center of her morphic memory and flipped all the switches, whether she wanted them switched or not. Full moon was only a couple of days away, and the delicious smell of the penned animals and the blood from the slaughterhouses was chiming against her strict vegetarianism. The clash was bringing on her PLT. She glared at the shadowy building in front of her. I think we'll go round the back, she said, and you can knock. Me? They won't take any notice of me, said Cheery. You show them your badge and tell them you're the watch. They'll ignore me. They'll laugh at me. You're going to have to do it sooner or later. Go on. The door was opened by a stout man in a bloody apron. He was shocked to have his belt grabbed by one dwarf hand while another dwarf hand was thrust in front of his face, holding a badge, and a dwarf voice in the region of his navel said, We're the watch, right? Oh, yes, and if you don't let us in, we'll have your guts for starters. Good try, murmured Angua. She lifted Cheery out of the way and smiled brightly at the butcher. Mr. Sock, we'd like to speak to an employee of yours, Mr. Dorful. The man hadn't quite got over Cheery, but he managed to rally, Mr. Dorful. What's he done now? We'd just like to talk to him. May we come in? Mr. Sock looked at Cheery, who was trembling with nerves and excitement. I have a choice, he said. Let's say you have a kind of choice, said Angua. She tried to close her nostrils against the beguiling miasma of blood. There was even a sausage factory on the premises. It used all the bits of animals no one would ever otherwise eat or even recognize. The odors of the abattoir turned her human stomach, but deep inside... Part of her sat up and drooled, and begged at the mingling smells of the pork and beef and lamb and mutton and... Rat, she said, sniffing. I didn't know you supplied the dwarf market, Mr. Sock. Mr. Sock was suddenly a man who wished to be seen to be cooperative. Dwarfel, come here right now. There was the sound of footsteps, and a figure emerged from behind a rack of beef carcasses. Some people had a thing about the undead. Angua knew Commander Vimes was uneasy in their presence, although he was getting better these days. People always needed someone to feel superior to. The living hated the undead, and the undead loathed, she felt her fists clench, the unalive. The golem called Dorful lurched a little because one leg was slightly shorter than the other. It didn't wear any clothes because there was nothing whatever to conceal, and so she could see the mottling on it where fresh clay had been added over the years. There was so much patching that she wondered how old it could be. Originally, some attempt had been made to depict human musculature, but the repairs had nearly obscured these. The thing looked like the kind of pots Igneous despised, the ones made by people who thought that because it was handmade it was supposed to look as if it was handmade, and that thumbprints baked in the clay were a sign of integrity. That was it. The thing looked handmade. Of course, over the years it had mostly made itself, one repair at a time. Its triangular eyes glowed faintly. There were no pupils, just the dark red glow of a banked fire. It was holding a long, heavy cleaver. Cheery's stare gravitated to this and remained fixed on it in terrified fascination. The other hand grasped a piece of string, on the end of which was a large, hairy, and very smelly goat. What are you doing, Dorful? The golem nodded towards the goat. Feeding the Judas goat? Dorful nodded again. Have you got something to do, Mr. Sock? said Angua. No, I've... You have got something to do, Mr. Sock, said Angua emphatically. Huh? Uh, uh yes, uh, yes, okay. I'll just go and see to the offal boilers. As the butcher walked away, he stopped to wave a finger under the place where Dorful's nose would be if the golem had had a nose. If you've been causing trouble, he began. I expect those boilers could really do with attention, said Angua sharply. He hurried off. There was silence in the yard, although the sounds of the city drifted in over the walls. From the other side of the slaughterhouse there was the occasional bleat of a worried sheep. 
Dorfel stood stock still, holding his cleaver and looking down at the ground. Is it a troll made to look like a human? whispered Cheery. Look at those eyes. It's not a troll, said Angua. It's a golem, a man of clay. It's a machine. It looks like a human. That's because it's a machine made for looking like a human. She walked around behind the thing. I'm going to read your chem, Dorfel, she said. The golem let go of the goat and raised the cleaver and brought it down sharply onto a chopping block beside Cheery, making the dwarf leap sideways. Then it pulled around a slate that was slung over its shoulder on a piece of string, unhooked the pencil, and wrote, Yes. When Angua put her hand up, Cheery realized that there was a thin line across the golem's forehead. To her horror, the entire top of the head flipped up. Angua, quite unperturbed, reached inside. Her hand came out holding a yellowing scroll. The golem froze. The eyes faded. Angua unrolled the paper. Some kind of holy writing, she said. It always is. Some old dead religion. You've killed it? No, you can't take away what isn't there. She put the scroll back and closed the head with a click. The golem came alive again, the glow returning to its eyes. Cheery had been holding her breath and came out in a rush. What did you do? she managed. Tow her, Dorful, said Angua. The golem's thick fingers were a blur as the pencil scratched across the slate. I am a golem. I was made of clay. My life is the words. By means of words of purpose in my head I acquire life. My life is to work. I obey all commands. I take no rest. What words of purpose? Relevant texts that are the focus of belief. Golem must work. Golem must have a master. The goat lay down beside the golem and started to chew cud. There have been two murders, said Angua. I'm pretty certain a golem did one, and probably both. Can you tell us anything, Dorful? Sorry, look, said Cheery. Are you telling me this thing is powered by words? I mean, is it telling me it's powered by words? Why not? Words do have power. Everyone knows that, said Angua. There are more golems around than you might think. They're out of fashion now, but they last. They can work underwater or in total darkness or knee-deep in poison. For years, they don't need rest or feeding. They... But that's slavery, said Cheery. Of course it isn't. You might as well enslave a doorknob. Have you got anything to tell me, Dorful? Cheery kept looking at the cleaver in the block. Words like length and heavy and sharp were filling her head more snugly than any words could have filled the clay skull of the golem. Dorful said nothing. How long have you been working here, Dorful? Now three hundred days already. And you have time off? To make a hollow laughing, what would I do with time off? I mean, you're not always in the slaughterhouse. Sometimes I make deliveries. And meet other golems? Now listen, Dorful, I know you things keep in touch somehow, and if a golem is killing real people, I wouldn't give a busted teacup for your chances. Folk will be along here straight away with flaming torches and sledgehammers. You get my drift? The golem shrugged. They cannot take away what does not exist, it wrote. Angua threw up her hands. I'm trying to be civilized, she said. I could confiscate you right now. The charge would be being obstructive when it's been a long day and I've had enough. Do you know Father Tubalcheck? The old priest who lives on the bridge. How come you know him? I have made deliveries there. He's been murdered. Where were you when he was killed? In the slaughterhouse. How do you know? Dorful hesitated a moment. Then the next words were written very slowly, as if they had come from a long way away after a great deal of thought. Because it is something that must have happened not long ago, because you are excited. For the last three days I have been working here. All the time? Yes. Twenty-four hours a day? 
Yes, men and trolls here on every shift they will tell you. During the day I must slaughter, dress, quarter, joint and bone, and at night without rest I must make sausages and boil up the livers, hearts, tripes, kidneys, and chitterlings. That's awful, said Cheery, the pencil blurred briefly. Close. Dorful turned his head slowly to look at Angua and wrote, Do you need me further? If we do, we know where to find you. I am sorry about the old man. Good. Come on, Cheery. They felt the golem's eyes on them as they left the yard. It was lying, said Cheery. Why did you say that? It looked as if it was lying. You're probably right, said Angua, but you can see the size of the place. I bet we wouldn't be able to prove it had stepped out for half an hour. I think I'll suggest that we put it under what Commander Vimes calls special surveillance. What, like plain clothes? Something like that, said Angua carefully. Funny to see a pet goat in a slaughterhouse, I thought, said Cheery, as they walked on through the fog. What? Oh, you mean the Eudis goat, said Angua. Most slaughterhouses have one. It's not a pet. I suppose you could call it an employee. Employee? What kind of job could it possibly do? Huh? Walk into the slaughterhouse every day. That's its job. Look, you've got a pen full of frightened animals, right? And they're milling around and leaderless. And there's this ramp into the building. Looks very scary. And hey, there's this goat. It's not scared. And so the flock follows it. And... Angua made a throat-slitting noise. Only the goat walks out. That's horrible. I suppose it makes sense from the goat's point of view. At least it does walk out, said Angua. How did you know about all this? Oh, you pick up all sorts of odds and ends of stuff in the watch. I've got a lot to learn, I can see, said Cheery. I never thought you had to carry bits of blanket for a start. It's special equipment if you're dealing with the undead. Well, I knew about garlic and vampires. Anything holy works on vampires. What else works on werewolves? Uh, sorry, said Angua, who was still thinking about the golem. I've got a silver mail vest which I promised my family I'd wear, but is anything else good for werewolves? A gin and tonic's always welcome, said Angua distantly. Angua? Hmm? Yes, what? Someone told me there was a werewolf in the watch. I can't believe that. Angua stopped and stared down at her. I mean, sooner or later, the wolf comes through, said Cheery. I'm surprised Commander Vimes allows it. There is a werewolf in the watch, yes, said Angua. I knew there was something odd about Constable Visit. Angua's jaw dropped. He always looks hungry, said Cheery, and he's got that odd smile all the time. I know a werewolf when I see one. He does look a bit hungry, that's true, said Angua. She couldn't think of anything else to say. Well, I'm going to be keeping my distance. Fine, said Angua. Angua? Yes? Why do you wear your badge on a collar round your neck? What? Oh, well, so it's um, always handy, you know, in any circumstances. Do I need to do that? I shouldn't think so. Mr. Sark jumped. Dorful, you damn stupid lump! Never sneak up behind the man on the bacon slicer. I've told you that before. Try to make some noise when you move, damn you. The golem held up its slate, which said, Tonight I cannot work. What's this? The bacon slicer never asks for time off. It is a holy day. Sock looked at the red eyes. Old Fishbine had said something about this, hadn't he, when he'd sold Dorful? Something like, sometimes it'll go off for a few hours because it's a holy day. It's the words in its head. If it doesn't go and trot off to its temple or whatever it is, the words will stop working. Don't ask me why there's no point in stopping it. Five hundred and thirty dollars the thing had cost. He thought it was a bargain. And it was a bargain, no doubt about that. The damn thing only ever stopped working when it had run out of things to do. Sometimes not even then, according to the stories. You heard about golems flooding out houses because no one told them to stop carrying water from the well, or washing the dishes until the plates were as thin as paper. Stupid things, but useful, if you kept your eye on them. And yet, and yet he could see why no one seemed to keep them for long. It was the way the damned two-handed engine just stood there, taking it all in and putting it, 
where, and never complained or spoke at all. A man could get worried about a bargain like that and feel mightily relieved when he was writing out a receipt for the new owner. Seems to me there's been a lot of holy days lately, said Sock. Sometimes are more holy than others. But they couldn't skive off, could they? Work was what a golem did. I don't know how we're going to manage, Sock began. It is a holy day. Oh, all right, you can have time off tomorrow. Tonight, holy day starts at sunset. Be back quickly then, said Sock weakly, or I'll... You be back quickly, do you hear? That was another thing. You couldn't threaten the creatures. You certainly couldn't withhold their pay because they didn't get any. You couldn't frighten them. Fishbein had said that a weaver over Knapp Hillway had ordered his golem to smash itself to bits with a hammer, and it had. Yes, I hear. In a way, it didn't matter who they were. In fact, their anonymity was part of the whole business. They thought themselves part of the march of history, the tide of progress, and the wave of the future. They were men who felt that the time had come. Regimes can survive barbarian hordes, crazed terrorists, and hooded secret societies, but they're in real trouble when prosperous and anonymous men sit around a big table and think thoughts like that. One said, At least it's clean this way. No blood. And it would be for the good of the city, of course. They nodded gravely. No one needed to say that what was good for them was good for Ark Morpork. And he won't die? Uh, apparently he can be kept merely uh, unwell. The dosage can be varied, I'm told. Good. I'd rather have him unwell than dead. I wouldn't trust Vetinari to stay in a grave. I've heard that he once said he'd prefer to be cremated, as a matter of fact. Then I just hope they scatter the ashes really widely, that's all. What about the watch? What about it? Ah. Lord Vetinari opened his eyes. Against all rationality, his hair ached. He concentrated, and a blur by the bed focused into the shape of Samuel Vimes. Ah, Vimes, he said weakly. How are you feeling, sir? Truly dreadful. Who was that little man with the incredibly bandy legs? That was Donut Jimmy, sir. He used to be a jockey on a very fat horse. A racehorse? Apparently, sir. A fat racehorse? Surely that could never win a race. I don't believe it ever did, sir, but Jimmy made a lot of money by not winning races. Ah, he gave me milk and some sort of sticky potion, Vetinari concentrated. I was heartily sick. So I understand, sir. Funny phrase, that, heartily sick. I wonder why it's a cliché. Sounds jolly. Rather cheerful, really. Yes, sir. Feel like I've got a bad dose of the flu, Vimes. Head not working mm, properly. Really, sir. The patrician thought for a while. There was obviously something else on his mind. Why did he still smell of horses, Vimes? He said at last. He's a horse doctor, sir, a damn good one. I heard last month he treated dire fortune and it didn't fall over until the last furlong. Doesn't sound helpful, Vimes. Oh, I don't know, sir. The horse had dropped dead coming up to the starting line. Ah, I see. Well, 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 what a nasty, suspicious mind you have, Vimes. Thank you, sir. The patrician raised himself on his elbows. Should toenails throb, Vimes? Couldn't say, sir. Now I think I should like to read for a while. Life goes on, huh? Vimes went to the window. There was a nightmarish figure crouched on the edge of the balcony outside, staring into the thickening fog. Everything all right, Constable Downspout? <sighs> yes, <Yeah. sighs> said the apparition.
I'll shut the window now. The fog is coming in. Right you are, sir. Vimes closed the window, trapping a few tendrils which gradually faded away. What was that? said Lord Vetinari. Constable Downspout's a gargoyle, sir. He's no good on parade and bloody useless on the street, but when it comes to staying in one place, sir, you can't beat him. He's world champion at not moving. If you want the winner of the hundred metres standing still, that's him. He spent three days on a roof in the rain when we caught the Park Lane nobbler. Nothing will get past him. And there's Corporal Gimlitson patrolling the corridor, and Constable Glod's nephew on the floor below, and Constable Flint and Moraine in the rooms on either side of you, and Sergeant Detritus will be around constantly, so that if anyone nods off, he'll kick ass, sir. And you'll know when he does that, because the poor bugger will come right through the wall. Well done, Vimes. Am I right in thinking that all my guards are non-human? They all seem to be dwarfs and trolls. Safest way, sir. You've thought of everything, Vimes. Hope so, sir. Thank you, Vimes. Vetinari sat up and took a mass of papers off the bedside table. And now, don't let me detain you. Vimes' mouth dropped open. Vetinari looked up. Was there anything else, Commander? Well, I suppose not, sir. I suppose I'd just better run along, eh? If you wouldn't mind. And I'm sure a lot of paperwork has accumulated in my office, so if you'd send someone to fetch it, I would be obliged. Vimes shut the door behind him, a little harder than necessary. Gods, it made him livid, the way Vetinari turned him on and off like a switch, and had as much natural gratitude as an alligator. The patrician relied on Vimes doing his job, knew he'd do his job, and that was the extent of his thoughts on the matter. Well, one day Vimes would... 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 Bloody well do his job, of course, because he didn't know how to do anything else. But realising that made it all the worse. Outside the palace, the fog was thick and yellow. Vimes nodded to the guards on the door and looked out at the clinging, swirling clouds. It was almost a straight line to the watchhouse in Pseudopolis Yard, and the fog had brought early night to the city. Not many people were on the streets. They stayed indoors, barring the windows against the damp shreds that seemed to leak in everywhere. Yes. Empty streets, a chilly night, dampness in the air. Only one thing was needed to make it perfect. He sent the sedan man on home and walked back to one of the guards. You're Constable Lucker, aren't you? Yes, sir, says Samuel. What size boots do you take? Lucker looked panicky. What, sir? It's a simple question, man. Seven and a half, sir. From old plugger in New Cobblers, the cheap ones? Yes, sir. Can't have a man guarding the palace in cardboard boots, said Vimes with mock cheerfulness. Off with them, Constable. You can have mine. They've still got wyvern. Well, whatever it is wyverns do on them. But they'll fit you. Don't stand there with your mouth open. Give me your boots, man. You can keep mine, Vimes added. I've got lots. The Constable watched in frightened astonishment as Vimes pulled on the cheap pair and stood upright, stamping a few times with his eyes shut. Ah, he said. I'm in front of the palace, right? Ah, uh, yes, sir. You've just come out of it, sir. It's this big building here. Ah, said Vimes brightly. But I'd know I was here, even if I hadn't. Ah, uh, it's the flagstones, said Vimes. They're an unusual size and slightly dished in the middle. Hadn't you noticed? Your feet, lad, that's what you'll have to learn to think with. The bemused constable watched him disappear into the fog, stamping happily. Corporal the Right Honourable the Earl of Onk Nobby Nobbs pushed open the watchhouse door and staggered inside. Sergeant Colon looked up from the desk and gasped. You okay, Nobby? he said, hurrying around to support the swaying figure. It's terrible, Fred. Terrible. Here, take a seat. You're all pale. I've been elevated, Fred, moaned Nobby. Nasty. Did you see who did it? Nobby wordlessly handed him the scroll Dragon King of Arms had pressed into his hand, and flopped back. He took a tiny length of homemade cigarette from behind his ear and lit it with a shaking hand. I don't know, I'm sure, he said. You do your best. You keep your head down. You don't make any trouble. And then something like this happens to you. Colon read the scroll slowly, his lips moving when he came to difficult words like and and the. Nobby, you've read this? It says, you're a lord. 
The old man said they'd have to do a lot of checking up, but he thought it was pretty clear what with the ring and all. Fred, what am I going to do? Sit back and eat off of him in place, as you think. That's just it, Fred. There's no money, no big house, no land, not a brass farthing. What, nothing? Not a dried pea, Fred. I thought all the upper crust had parts of money. Well, I'm the crust on its uppers, Fred. I don't know anything about lording. I don't want to have to wear posh clothes and go to hunt balls and all that stuff. Sergeant Colon sat down beside him. You never suspected you'd got any posh connections? Well, my cousin Vincent once got done for indecently assaulting the Duchess of Quirm's housemaid. Chambermaid or scullery maid? Scullery maid, I think. Probably doesn't count, then. Does anyone else know about all this? Well, she did. And she went and told... I mean about your lordshipping. Only Mr. Vimes. Well, there you are, said Sergeant Colon, handing him back the scroll. You don't have to tell anyone. Then you don't have to go around wearing golden trousers, and you needn't hunt balls unless you've lost them. You just sit there and I'll fetch you a cup of tea. How about that? We'll see it through, don't you worry. You're a tough, Fred. That makes two of us, my lord, Colon waggled his eyebrows. Get it? <laughs> Get it? Don't, Fred, said Nobby wearily. The watchhouse door opened. Fog poured in like smoke. In the midst of it were two red eyes. The parting shreds revealed the massive figure of a golem. <laughs> said Sergeant Colon. The golem held up its slate. I have come to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've, uh, uh, yeah, oh yeah, I can see that, said Colin. Dorful turned the slate round. The other side read, I give myself up for murder. It was I who killed the old priest. The crime is solved. Colon, once his lips had stopped moving, scurried behind the suddenly very flimsy defences of his desk and scrabbled through the papers there. You keep it covered, Nobby, he said. Make sure it don't run off. Why is it going to run off, said Nobby. Sergeant Colon found a relatively clean piece of paper. Well, 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 uh, I, uh, well I guess I'd better... Uh, 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 what's your name? The golem wrote, Dorful. By the time he was on the brass bridge, medium-sized cobbles of the rounded sort they called catheads, quite a few missing, Vimes was already beginning to wonder if he'd done the right thing. Autumn fogs were always thick, but he'd never known it this bad. The pall muffled the sounds of the city and turned the brightest lights into dim glows, even though in theory the sun hadn't set yet. He walked along by the parapet. A squat, glistening shape loomed in the fog. It was one of the wooden hippos, some distant ancestor of Roderick or Keith. There were four on either side, all looking out towards the sea. Vimes had walked past them thousands of times. They were old friends. He'd often stood in the lee of one on chilly nights when he was looking for somewhere out of trouble. That's what it used to be like, wasn't it? It hardly seemed that long ago, just a handful of them in the watch, staying out of trouble. And then... Carrot had arrived, and suddenly the narrow circuit of their lives had opened up, and there were nearly thirty men, oh, including trolls and dwarfs and miscellaneous, in the watch now, and they didn't skulk around keeping out of trouble, they went looking for trouble, and they found it everywhere they looked. Funny that. As Vetinari had pointed out in that way of his, the more policemen you had, the more crimes seemed to be committed. But the watch was back and out there on the streets, and if they weren't actually as good as detritus at kicking ass, they were definitely prodding buttock. He lit a match on a hippo's toenail and cupped his hand around it to shield his cigar from the damp. These murders now. No one would care if the watch didn't care. Two old men murdered on the same day, nothing stolen. He'd corrected himself, nothing apparently stolen. Of course, the thing about things that were stolen was that the bloody things weren't there. They almost certainly hadn't been fooling around with other people's wives. They probably couldn't remember what fooling around was. One spent his time among old religious books. The other, for God's sakes, was an authority on the aggressive uses of baking. People would probably say they had lived blameless lives. 
that Vimes was a policeman. No one lived a completely blameless life. It might be just possible, by lying very still in a cellar somewhere, to get through a day without committing a crime, but only just, and even then you were probably guilty of loitering. Anyway, Angua seemed to have taken this case personally. She always had a soft spot for the underdog. So did Vimes. You had to, not because they were pure or noble, because they weren't. You had to be on the side of underdogs, because they weren't overdogs. Everyone in this city looked after themselves. That's what the guilds were for. People banded together against other people. The guilds looked after you from the cradle to the grave, or in the case of the assassins, to other people's graves. They even maintained the law, or at least they had done after a fashion. Thieving without a license was punishable by death for the first offence. The Aunt Morpork view of crime and punishment was that the penalty for the first offence should prevent the possibility of a second offence. The Thieves' Guild saw to that. The arrangement sounded unreal, but it worked. It worked like a machine. That was fine, except for the occasional people who got crushed in the wheels. The damp cobbles felt reassuringly real under his souls. God, he'd missed this. He'd patrolled alone in the old days. When there was just him, and the stones glistened around 3 a.m., it all seemed to make sense somehow. He stopped. Around him the world became a crystal of horror, the special horror that has nothing to do with fangs, or each or, or ghosts, but has everything to do with the familiar becoming unfamiliar. Something fundamental was wrong. It took a few dreadful seconds for his mind to supply the details of what his subconscious had noticed. There had been five statues along the parapet on this side, but there should have been four. He turned very slowly and walked back to the last one. It was a hippo, all right. So was the next one. There was graffiti on it. Nothing supernatural had Zaz is a Wonka scrawled on it. It seemed to him that it didn't take quite so long to get to the next one, and when he looked at it, two red points of light flared in the fog above him. Something big and dark leapt down, knocked him to the ground, and disappeared into the gloom. Vimes struggled to his feet, shook his head, and set off after it. No thought was involved. It is the ancient instinct of terriers and policemen to chase anything that runs away. And as he ran, he felt automatically for his bell, which would summon other watchmen. But the commander of the watch didn't carry a bell. Commanders of the watch were on their own. In Vimes's squalid office, Captain Carrot stared at a piece of paper. Repairs to guttering, watch house, Pseudopolis Yard. New downpipe, 35 degrees, Micklewhite bend, four right-angled trusses, labor and making good, $16.35. There were more like them, including Constable Downspout's pigeon bill. He knew Sergeant Colon objected to the idea of a policeman being paid in pigeons, but Constable Downspout was a gargoyle, and gargoyles had no concept of money. But they knew a pigeon when they ate it. Still, things were improving. When Carrot had arrived, the entire watch's petty cash had been kept on a shelf in a tin marked Strong in the Arms Armour Polish for Gleaming Cohorts. And if money was needed for anything, all you had to do was go and find Nobby and force him to give it back. Then there was a letter from a resident in Park Lane, one of the most select addresses in the city. Commander Vimes, the night watch patrol in this street appears to be made up entirely of dwarfs. I have nothing against dwarfs among their own kind, at least they are not trolls, but one hears stories, and I have daughters in the house. I demand that this situation is remedied instantly, otherwise I shall have no option but to take up the matter with Lord Vetinari, who is a personal friend. I am, sir, your obedient servant, Joshua H. Catterail. This was police work, was it? He wondered if Mr. Vimes were trying to tell him something. There were other letters. The Community Coordinator of Equal Heights for Dwarfs was demanding that dwarfs in the watch be allowed to carry an axe rather than the traditional sword, and should be sent to investigate only those crimes committed by tall people. The Thieves' Guild was complaining that Commander Vimes had said publicly that most thefts were committed by thieves. You'd need the wisdom of King Isaiah Danu to tackle them and these were only today's letters. He picked up the next one and read, Translation of text found in Father Tubelchek's mouth, Y. S. V. Carrot dutifully read the translation. In his mouth? Someone tried to put words in his mouth, said Carrot to the silent room. He shivered, but not because of the cold that came from fear, 
Vimes's office was always cold. Vimes was an outdoors person. Fog was dancing in the open window, little fingers of it drifting in the light. The next paper down the heap was a copy of Cheery's iconograph. Carrot stared at the two blurred red eyes. Captain Carrot! He half turned his head, but kept looking at the picture. Yes, Fred? We've got the murderer! We've got him! Is he a golem? How did you know that? The tincture of night began to suffuse the soup of the afternoon. Lord Vetinare considered the sentence, and found it good. He liked tincture particularly. Tincture. Tincture. It was a distinguished word, and pleasantly countered by the flatness of soup. The soup of the afternoon. Yes, in which may well be found the croutons of tea-time. He was aware that he was a little light-headed. He'd never have thought a sentence like that in a normal frame of mind. In the fog outside the window, just visible by the candlelight, he saw the crouching shape of Constable Downspout. A gargoyle, huh? He'd wondered why the watch was indented for five pigeons a week on its wages bill. A gargoyle in the watch whose job it was to watch. That would be Captain Carrot's idea. Lord Vetinari got up carefully from the bed and closed the shutters. He walked slowly to his writing table, pulled his journal out of its drawer, then tugged out a wad of manuscript and unstoppered the ink bottle. Now then, where had he got to? Chapter 8, he read unsteadily, The Rights of Man. Ah, yes. Concerning truth, he wrote, that which may be spoken as events dictate, but should be heard on every occasion. He wondered how he could work soup of the afternoon into the treaties, or at least tincture of night. The pen scratched across the paper. Unheeded on the floor lay the tray that had contained a bowl of nourishing gruel, concerning which he had resolved to have strong words with the cook when he felt better. It had been tasted by three tasters, including Sergeant Detritus, who was unlikely to be poisoned by anything that worked on humans or even by most things that worked on trolls, but probably by most things that worked on trolls. The door was locked. Occasionally he could hear the reassuring creak of Detritus on his rounds. Outside the window the fog condensed on Constable Downspout. Vetinari dipped the pen in the ink and started a new page. Every so often he consulted the leather-bound journal, licking his fingers delicately to turn the thin pages. Tendrils of fog slipped in around the shutters and brushed against the wall until they were frightened away by the candlelight. Vimes pounded through the fog after the fleeing figure. It wasn't quite so fast as him, despite the twinges in his legs and one or two warning stabs from his left knee, but whenever he came close to it some muffled pedestrian got in the way, or a cart pulled out of a cross street. As always happens in any police chase anywhere, a heavily laden lorry will always pull out of a side alley in front of the pursuit. If vehicles aren't involved, then it'll be a man with a rack of garments, or two men with a large sheet of glass. There's probably some kind of secret society behind all this. His souls told him that they'd gone right down Broadway and had turned left into Nunsuch Street, small square paving stones. The fog was even thicker here, trapped between the trees of the park. But Vimes was triumphant. You've missed your turning if you're heading for the shades, my lad. There's only the Ark Bridge now, and there'll be a guard on that. His feet told him something else. They said, wet leaves. That's none such street in the autumn. Small square paving stones with occasional treacherous drifts of wet leaves. They said it too late. Vimes landed on his chin in the gutter, staggered upright, fell over again as the rest of the universe spun past, got up, tottered a few steps in the wrong direction, fell over again, and decided to accept the majority vote for a while. Dorful was standing quietly in the station office, heavy arms folded across its chest. In front of the golem was the crossbow belonging to Sergeant Tritus, which had been converted from an ancient siege weapon. It fired a six-foot-long iron arrow. Nobby sat behind it, his finger on the trigger. "'Put it away, Nobby. You can't fire that in here,' said Carrot. "'You know we never find where the arrows stop.' We wrestled a confession out of it, said Sergeant Colon, hopping up and down. It kept on admitting it, but we got it to confess in the end. And we've got those other crimes we'd like taken into consideration. Dorful held up its slate. I am guilty, 
Something fell out of its hand. It was short and white, a piece of matchstick by the look of it. Carrot picked it up and stared at it. Then he looked at the list Colin had drawn up. It was quite long and consisted of every unsolved crime in the city for the past couple of months. It's confessed to all these? Not yet, said Nobby. We haven't read them all out yet, said Colin. Dorful wrote, I did everything. Hey, said Colin, Mr. Vimes is going to be really pleased with us. Carrot walked up to the golem. There was a faint orange glow in its eyes. Did you kill Father Tubalcheck? he said. Yes. See, said Sergeant Colin, you can't argue with that. Why did you do it? said Carrot. No reply. And Mr. Hopkinson at the Bread Museum? Yes. You beat him to death with an iron bar? said Carrot. Yes. Hang on, said Colin. I thought you said he was... Leave it, Fred, said Carrot. Why did you kill the old man, Dorful? No reply. Does there have to be a reason? You can't trust golems, my dad always used to say, said Colin. Turn on you as soon as look at you, he said. Have they ever killed anyone, said Carrot. Not for want of thinking about it, said Colin, darkly. My dad said he had to work with one once, and it used to look at him all the time. He'd turn around and there it would be, looking at him. Dorful sat staring straight in front. Shine a candle in its eyes, said Nobby. Carrot pulled a chair across the floor and straddled it facing Dorful. He absentmindedly twirled the broken match between his fingers. I know you didn't kill Mr. Hopkinson, and I don't think you killed Father Tubalcheck, he said. I think he was dying when you found him. I think you tried to save him, Dorful. In fact, I'm pretty sure I can prove it if I can see your chem. The light from the golem's flaring eyes filled the room. He stepped forward, fists upraised. Nobby fired the crossbow. Dorful snatched the long bolt out of the air. There was the sound of screaming metal, and the bolt became a thin bar of red-hot iron with a bulge piled up around the golem's grip. But Carrot was behind the golem, flipping open its head. As the golem turned, raising the iron bar like a club, the fire died in its eyes. Got it, said Carrot, holding up a yellowed scroll. At the end of Nunsuch Street was a gibbet, where wrongdoers, or at least people found guilty of wrongdoing, had been hung to twist gently in the wind as examples of just retribution, and as the elements took their toll, basic anatomy as well. Once parties of children were brought there by their parents to learn by dreadful example of the snares and perils that await the criminal, the outlaw, and those who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they would see the terrible wreckage creaking on its chain and listen to the stern imprecations, and then usually, this being Ankh Morpork, would say, Wow! Brilliant! and use the corpse as a swing. These days the city had more private and efficient ways of dealing with those it found surplus to requirements. But for the sake of tradition, the gibbet's incumbent was a quite realistic wooden body. The occasional stupid raven would have a peck at the eyeballs even now and end up with a much shorter beak. Vimes tottered up to it, fighting for breath. The quarry could have gone anywhere by now. Such daylight as had been filtering through the fog had given up. Vimes stood beside the gibbet, which creaked. It had been built to creak. What's the good of a public display of retribution, it had been argued, if it didn't creak ominously? In richer times, an elderly man had been employed to operate the creek by means of a length of string, but now there was a clockwork mechanism that needed to be wound up only once a month. Condensation dripped off the artificial corpse. Blow this for a lark, muttered Vimes, and tried to head back the way he came. After ten seconds of blundering, he tripped over something. It was a wooden corpse hurled into the gutter. When he got back to the gibbet, the empty chain was swinging gently, jingling in the fog. Sergeant Colan tapped the golem's chest. It went donk. Like a flower pot, said Nobby. How can they move around when they're like a pot, eh? They ought to keep cracking all the time. They're daft, too, said Colan. I heard there was one over in Querm who was made to dig a trench, and they forgot all about it, and they only remembered it when there was all this water because it had dug all the way to the river. Carrot unrolled the chem on the table and laid beside it the paper that had been put in Father Tubalcheck's mouth. It's dead, is it? said Sergeant Colan. It's harmless, said Carrot, looking from one piece of paper to the other. Right. I've got a sledgehammer around the back somewhere. I'll just... 
No, said Carrot. You saw the way it was acting. I don't think it could actually have hit me. I think it just wanted to scare us. It worked. Look at these, Fred. Sergeant Colan glanced at the desk. Foreign writing, he said, in a voice which suggested that it was nothing like as good as decent home writing, and probably smelled of garlic. Anything strike you about them? Well, they look the same, Sergeant Colan conceded. This yellowing one is Dorfel's chem. The other one is from Father Tubalcheck, said Carrot. Letter for letter the same. Why is that? I think Dorfel wrote these words and put them in old Tubalcheck's mouth after the poor man died, said Carrot slowly, still looking from one piece of paper to the other. Ugh, yuck, said Nobby. That's mucky, that is. No, you don't understand, said Carrot. I mean he wrote them because they were the only ones he knew that worked. Worked how? Well, you know, the kiss of life, said Carrot. I mean, first aid. I know you know, Nobby. You came with me when they had that course at the YMPA. I only went because you said you got a free cup of tea and a biscuit, said Nobby sulkily. Anyway, the dummy ran away when it was my turn. It's the same with life-saving, too, said Carrot. We want people to breathe, so we try to make sure they've got some air in them. They all turned to look at the golem. But golems don't breathe, said Colin. No, a golem knows only one thing that keeps you alive, said Carrot. It's the words in your head. They all turned back to look at the words. They all turned to look at the statue that was awful. Phew, it's gone all cold in here, Nobby quavered. I definitely felt an aura flickering in the air just then. It was like someone... What's going on? said Vimes, shaking the damp off his cloak. Opening the door, said Nobby. It was ten minutes later. Sergeant Colon and Nobby had gone off duty to everyone's relief. Colon, in particular, had great difficulty with the idea that you went on investigating after someone had confessed. It outraged his training and experience. You got a confession, and there it ended. You didn't go around disbelieving people. You disbelieved people only when they said they were innocent. Only guilty people were trustworthy. Anything else struck at the whole basis of policing. White clay, said Carrot. It was white clay we found, and practically unbaked. Dorfels made of dark terracotta and rock hard. The last thing the old priest saw was a golem, said Vimes. Dorfel, I'm sure, said Carrot, but that's not the same as saying Dorfel was the murderer. I think he turned up as the man was dying, that's all. Oh, why? I'm not sure yet, but I've seen Dorfel around. He's always seemed a very gentle person. He works in a slaughterhouse. Maybe that's not a bad place for a gentle person to work, sir, said Carrot. Anyway, I've checked up all the records I can find, and I don't think a golem has ever attacked anyone, or committed any kind of crime. Oh, come on, said Vimes. Everyone knows. He stopped as his cynical ears heard his incredulous voice. What, never? Oh, people are always saying that they know someone who has a friend whose grandfather heard of one killing someone, and that's about as real as it gets, sir. Golems aren't allowed to hurt people. It's in their words. They give me the willies, I know that, said Vimes. They give everyone the willies, sir. You hear lots of stories about them doing stupid things like making a thousand teapots or digging a hole five miles deep, said Vimes. Yes, but that's not exactly criminal activity, is it, sir? That's just ordinary rebellion. What do you mean, rebellion? Dumbly obeying orders, sir. You know, someone shouts at it, go and make teapots, so it does. Can't be blamed for obeying orders, sir. No one told them how many. No one wants them to think, so they get their own back by not thinking. They rebel by working. It's just a thought, sir. It'd make more sense to a golem, I expect. Automatically they turned again to look at the silent shape of the golem. Can it hear us? said Vimes. I don't think so, sir. This business with the words. Er, uh, I think they think a dead human is just someone who's lost his kin. I don't think they understand how we work, sir. Them and me both, Captain. Vimes stared at the hollow eyes. The top of Dorfel's head was still open so that light shone down through the sockets. Vimes had seen many horrible things on the street, but the silent golem was somehow worse. You could too easily imagine the eyes flaring and the thing standing up and striding forward, fists flailing like sledgehammers. It was more than just his imagination. It seemed to be built into the things. 
a potentiality biding its time. That's why we all hate them, he thought. Those expressionless eyes watch us, those big faces turn to follow us. And doesn't it just look as if they're making notes and taking names? If you heard that one had bashed in someone's head over in Quirm or somewhere, wouldn't you just love to believe it? A voice inside, a voice which generally came to him only in the quiet hours of the night, or in the old days halfway down a whiskey bottle, added, Given how we use them, maybe we're scared because we know we deserve it. No, there's nothing behind those eyes. There's just clay and magic words. Vimes shrugged. I chased a golem earlier, he said. It was standing on the brass bridge, damn thing. Look, we've got a confession and the eyeball evidence. If you can't come up with anything better than a feeling, then we'll have to... To what, sir? said Carrot. There isn't anything more we could do to him. He's dead now. Inanimate, you mean? Yes, sir, if you want to put it that way. If Dorfel didn't kill the old men, who did? Don't know, sir, but I think Dorfel does. Maybe he was following the murderer. Could it have been ordered to protect someone? Maybe, sir. Or he decided to. You'll be telling me it's got emotions next. Where's Angua gone? She thought she'd check a few things, sir, said Carrot. I was puzzled about this, sir. It was in his hand. He held up the object. A piece of matchstick? Golems don't smoke, and they don't use fire, sir. It's just odd that he should have the thing, sir. Oh, said Vimes sarcastically. A clue. Dorfel's trail was the word on the street. The mixed smells of the slaughterhouse filled Angua's nostrils. The journey zigzagged, but with a certain directional tendency. It was as if the golem had laid a ruler across the town and taken every road and alley that went in the right direction. She came to a short, blind alley. There were some warehouse gates at the end. She sniffed. There were plenty of other smells, too. Dough, paint, grease, pine resin. Sharp, loud, fresh scents. She sniffed again. Cloth? Wool? There was a confusion of footprints in the dirt, large footprints. The small part of Angua that always walked on two legs saw that the footprints coming out were on top of the footprints going in. She snuffled around. Up to twelve creatures, each with their own very distinctive smell, the smell of merchandise rather than living creatures, had all very recently gone down the stairwell, and all twelve had come back up. She went down the steps and was met by an impenetrable barrier, a door. Paws were no good at doorknobs. She peered over the top of the steps. There was no one around, only the fog hung between the buildings. She concentrated and changed, leaned against the wall for a moment until the world stopped spinning, and tried the door. There was a large cellar beyond. Even with a werewolf's eyesight, there wasn't much to see. She had to stay human. She thought better when she was human. Unfortunately, here and now, as a human, the thought occupying her mind in no small measure was that she was naked. Anyone finding a naked woman in their cellar would be bound to ask questions. They might not even bother with questions, even ones like, please. Angua could certainly deal with that situation, but she preferred not to have to. It was so difficult explaining away the shape of the wounds. No time to waste, then. The walls were covered in writing. Big letters, small letters, but all in that neat script which the golems used. There were phrases in chalk and paint and charcoal, and in some cases simply cut into the stone itself. They reached from floor to ceiling, crisscrossing one another over and over again, so often that it was almost impossible to make out what any of them were meant to say. Here and there a word or two stood out in the jumble of letters. Shalt not. What he does is not. Rage at the Creator. Woe unto the masterless. Words in the play of our let my bring us to free. The dust in the middle of the floor was scuffed, as if a number of people had been milling around. She crouched down and rubbed the dirt, occasionally sniffing her finger. Smells. They were industrial smells. She hardly needed special senses to detect them. A golem didn't smell of anything except clay and whatever it was it was working with at the time. And something rolled under her fingers. It was a length of wood only a couple of inches long. A matchstick without a head.
A few minutes' investigation found another ten lying here and there as if they'd been idly dropped. There was also half a stick, tossed away some distance from the others. Her night vision was fading, but sense of smell lasted much longer. Smells were strong on the sticks. The same cocktail of odours that had trailed into this damp room. But the slaughterhouse smell she'd come to associate with Dorful was on only the broken piece. She sat back on her haunches and looked at the little heap of wood. Twelve people, twelve people in messy jobs, had come here. They hadn't stayed long. They'd had a discussion, the writing on the wall. They'd done something involving eleven matches, just the wooden part. They hadn't been dipped to get the head. Maybe the pine-smelling golem worked in a match factory. Plus one broken match. Then they'd all left and gone their separate ways. Dorfel's way had taken him straight to the main watch house to give himself up. Why? She sniffed at the piece of broken match again. There was no doubt about the cocktail of blood and meat smells. Dorfel had given himself up for murder. She stared at the writing on the wall and shivered. Cheers, Fred, said Nobby, raising his pint. We can put the money back in the tea club tomorrow. No one will miss it, said Sergeant Colon. Anyway, this comes under the heading of an emergency. Corporal Nobbs looked despondently into his glass. People often did this in the mended drum, when the immediate thirst had been slaked, and for the first time they could take a good look at what they were drinking. What am I going to do? he moaned. If you're a knob, you've got to wear coronets and long robes and that. Got to cost a mint, that kind of stuff. And there's stuff you've got to do. He took another long swig. It's called Noblus Obligi. Nobly yes obligay, corrected Colon. Yeah, means you've got to keep your end up in society, giving money to charities, being kind to the poor, passing your old clothes to your gardener when there's still some good wear left in them. I know about that. My uncle was butler to old Lady Salachi. Ain't got a gardener, said Nobby gloomily. Ain't got a garden. Ain't got any old clothes except what I'm wearing. He took another swig. She gave her old clothes to the gardener, did she? Colin nodded. Yeah, we were always a bit puzzled about that gardener. He caught the barman's eye. Two more pints of winkles, Ron. He glanced at Nobby. His old friend looked more dejected than he'd ever seen him. They'd have to see this thing through together. Better make that two for Nobby, too, he added. Cheers, Fred. Sergeant Colin's eyebrows raised as one pint was emptied almost in one go. Nobby put the mug down a little unsteadily. Wouldn't be so bad if there was a pot of cash, Nobby said, picking up the other mug. I thought you couldn't be a knob without being a rich bugger. I thought they gave you a big wad with one hand and banged the crown on your head with the other. Don't make sense, being knobby and poor. It's worse to both worlds. He drained the mug and banged it down. Common and rich. Yeah, that I could help. The barman leaned over to Sergeant Colan. What's up with the corporal? He's a half-pint man. That's eight pints he's had. Fred Colan leaned closer and spoke out of the corner of his mouth. Keep it to yourself, Ron, but it's because he's a peer. Is that a fact? I'll go and put down some fresh sawdust. In the watch house, Sam Vimes prodded the matches. He didn't ask Angua if she was sure. Angua could smell if it was Wednesday. So, who were the others, he said. Other golems? It's hard to tell from the tracks, said Angua, but I think so. I'd have followed them, but I thought I ought to come right back here. What makes you think they were golems? The footprints. And golems have no smell, she said. They pick up the smells associated with whatever they're doing. That's all they smell of. She thought of the wall of words. And they had a long debate, she said. A golem argument. In writing. It got pretty heated, I think. She thought about the wall again. Some of them got quite emphatic, she added, remembering the size of some of the lettering. If they were human, they'd have been shouting. Vimes stared gloomily at the matches laid out before him, eleven bits of wood and a twelfth broken in two. You didn't need to be any kind of genius to see what had been going on. They drew lots, he said, and Dorful lost. He sighed. This is getting worse, he said. Does anyone know how many golems there are in the city? No, said Carrot. Hard to find out. No one's made any for centuries, but they don't wear out. No one makes them. It's banned, sir. The priests are pretty hot on that, sir. They say it's making life, and that's something only gods are supposed to do. But they put up with the ones that are still around because, well, they're so useful. 
Some are walled up or in treadmills or at the bottom of shafts, doing messy tasks, you know, in places where it's dangerous to go. They do all the really mucky jobs. I suppose there could be hundreds. Hundreds, said Vimes. And now they meet secretly and make plots. Good grief. Right. We ought to destroy the lot of them. Why? You like the idea of them having secrets? I mean, good grief. Trolls and dwarfs are fine. Even the undead are alive in a way, even if it is a bloody awful way. Vimes caught Angua's eye and went on, for the most part. But these things, they're just things that do work. It's like having a bunch of shovels meeting for a chat. Er... Uh, there was something else, sir, said Angua slowly, in the cellar. Yes, um, but it's hard to explain. It was a feeling. Vimes shrugged non-committally. He'd learned not to scoff at Angua's feelings. She always knew where Carrot was, for one thing. If she were in the watch house, you could tell if he were coming up the street by the way she turned to look at the door. Yes? Like deep grief, sir. Terrible, terrible sadness. Um, Vimes nodded and pinched the bridge of his nose. It seems to have been a long day, and it was far from over yet. He really, really needed a drink. The world was distorted enough as it was. When you saw it through the bottom of a glass, it all came back into focus. Have you had anything to eat today, sir? said Angua. I had a bit of breakfast, muttered Vimes. You know that word Sergeant Colan uses? What, manky? That's how you look. If you're staying here, at least let's have some coffee and send out for figgins. Vimes hesitated at that. He'd always imagined that manky was how your mouth felt after three days on a regurgitated diet. It was horrible to think that you could look like that. Angua reached for the old coffee tin that represented the watch's tea kitty. It was surprisingly easy to lift. Hey, there should be at least twenty-five dollars in here, she said. Nobby collected it only yesterday. She turned the tin upside down. A very small dog end dropped out. Not even an I.O.U., said Carrot despondently. An I.O.U.? This is Nobby we're talking about. Oh, of course. It had gone very quiet in the mended drum. Happy hour had been passed with no more than a minor fight. Now everyone was watching unhappy hour. There was a forest of mugs in front of Nobby. I mean... I mean, what's it worth when all's said and done, he said. You could flog it, said Ron. Good point, said Sergeant Colan. There's plenty of rich folks who'd give a sack of cash for a title. I mean, folks that's already got the big house and that. They'd give anything to be as nobby as you, Nobby. The ninth pint stopped halfway to Nobby's lips. Could be worth thousands of dollars, said Ron encouragingly. At the very least, said Colan. They'd fight over it. You play your cards right and you could retire on something like that, said Ron. The mug remained stationary. Various expressions fought their way around the lumps and excrescences of Nobby's face, suggesting the terrible battle within. Oh, they would, would they? he said at last. Sergeant Colan tilted unsteadily away. There was an edge in Nobby's voice he hadn't heard before. Then you could be rich and common, just like you said, said Ron, who didn't have quite the same eye for mental weather changes. Posh folks would be falling over themselves for it. Sell my birthright for a spot of massage? Is that it? said Nobby. It's a pot of message, said Sergeant Colan. It's a mess of pottage, said a bystander, anxious not to break the flow. Ha ha! Well, I'll tell you, said Nobby, swaying. There's some things that can't be sold, huh? Eh? Eh? Who streals my purse? Streels the trash, right? Yeah, it's the trashiest looking purse I ever saw, said a voice. What is a mess of pottage anyway? Cos what good is a lot of money do me, eh? The clientele looked puzzled. This seemed to be a question on the lines of alcohol, is it nice? Or hard work, do you want to do it? What's messy about it then? Well, said a brave soul uncertainly, you could use it to buy a big house, lots of grub and drink and, uh, and, 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 and women and that. That's what it takes to make a man happy, is it? said Nobby, glassy-eyed. His fellow drinkers just stared. 
This was a metaphysical maze. Well, I'll tell you, said Nobby, the swaying now so regular that he looked like an inverted pendulum. All that stuff's nothing. Nothing, I tell you, compared to pride in a man's linen yinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyinyin
You boys new in town? said Mr. Cheese, buffing a glass. The boldest of the three waved his bow under the barman's nose. All the money right now, he screamed. Otherwise, he said to the room in general, you've got a dead barman. Plenty of other bars in town, boyo, said a voice. Mr. Cheese didn't look up from the glass he was polishing. I know that was you, Constable Thighbiter, he said calmly. There's two dollars and thirty pence on your slate. Thank you very much. The thieves drew closer together. Bars shouldn't act like this, and they fancied they could hear the faint sliding noises of assorted weapons being drawn from various sheaths. "'Haven't I seen you before?' said Carrot. "'Oh, gods, it's him!' moaned one of the men. "'The bread-thrower!' "'I thought Mr. Ironcrust was taking you to the Thieves' Guild,' Carrot went on. "'There was a bit of an argument about taxes. Don't tell him!' Carrot tapped his head. The tax forms, he said. I expect Mr. Ironcrust is worried I've forgotten about them. The thieves were now so close together, they looked like a fat six-armed man with a very large bill for hats. Er, uh, watchmen aren't allowed to kill people, right? said one of them. Not while we're on duty, said Vimes. The boldest of the three moved suddenly, grabbed Angua, and pulled her upright. We walk out of here unharmed or the girl gets it, all right, he snarled. Someone sniggered. I hope you're not going to kill anyone, said Carrot. That's up to us. Sorry? Was I talking to you? said Carrot. Don't worry, I'll be fine, said Angua. She looked around to make sure Cheery wasn't there, and then sighed. Come on, gentlemen, let's get it over with. Don't play with your food, said a voice from the crowd. There were one or two giggles until Carrot turned in his seat, whereupon everyone was suddenly intensely interested in their drinks. It's okay, said Angua, quietly. Aware that something was out of kilter, but not quite sure what it was, the thieves edged back to the door. No one moved as they unbolted it, and still holding Angua, stepped out into the fog, shutting the door behind them. "'Hadn't we better help?' said a constable, who was new to the watch. "'They don't deserve help,' said Vimes. There was a clank of armour, and then a long, deep growl right outside in the street, and a scream. And then another scream and a third scream, modulated with, No, 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 no! Ah! 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 Something heavy hit the door. Vimes turned back to Carrot. You and Constable Angua, he said. You, uh, get along all right? Fine, sir, said Carrot. Some people might think that, uh, there might be, uh, problems. There was a thud, and then a faint, bubbling noise. We work around them, sir, said Carrot, raising his voice slightly. I heard that her father's not very happy about her work in here. They don't have much law up in Uberwald, sir. They think it's for weak societies. The Baron's not a very civic-minded man. He's pretty bloodthirsty from what I've heard. She wants to stay in the watch, sir. She likes meeting people. From outside came another gurgle. Fingernails scrabbled at a window pane. Then their owner disappeared abruptly from view. Well, it's not for me to judge, said Vimes. No, sir. After a few moments of silence, the door opened slowly. Angua walked in, adjusting her clothes, and sat down. All the watchmen in the room suddenly took a second course of advanced beer study. Er, uh, Carrot began. Flesh wounds, said Angua, but one of them did shoot one of the others in the leg by accident. I think you'd better put it in your report as self-inflicted wounds while resisting arrest, said Vimes. Yes, sir, said Angua. Not all of them, said Carrot. They tried to rob our bar and take a werewolf, uh, Angua, hostage, said Vimes. Oh, I see what you mean, sir, said Carrot. Self-inflicted. Yes, of course. It had gone quiet in the mended drum. This was because it is usually very hard to be both loud and unconscious. Sergeant Colan was impressed at his own cleverness. Throwing a punch could stop a fight, of course, but in this case... It had a quarter of rum, gin, and sixteen chopped lemons floating in it. Some people were still upright, however. They were the serious drinkers who drank as if there was no tomorrow and rather hoped this would be the case. Fred Colon had reached the convivial drunk stage. He turned to the man beside him. It's good here, isn't it? he managed. Why am I going to tell me wife? That's what I want to know, moaned the man. Do you know, say you've been, been... Been working late, said Colin, and suck a peppermint before you goes home. That usually works. Working late, huh? I've been given the sack, me. A craftsman, 
15 years at Spadger and Williams, right? And then they go bust because of Carrie undercutting them and I get a job at Carrie's and bang, I'm out of a job there too. Surplus to requirements. Bloody golems forcing real people out of a job. What they want to work for, they got no mouth to feed. <laughs> but the damn thing goes at it so fast you can't see its bloody arms moving. Shame. Smash him up, that's what I say. I mean, we had a golem at S&W's, but old schlob just used to plod along, you know, not buzz away like a blue arse fly. You want to watch it, mate. They'll have your job next. Stoneface wouldn't stand for it, said Colin, undulating gently. Any chance of a job with you lot, then? You know, said Colin. The man seems to have become two men. What's it you do? I'm a wick dipper and end teaser, mate, they said. I can see that's a useful trade. Here you go, Fred, said the barman, tapping him on the shoulder and putting a piece of paper in front of him. Colan watched with interest as figures danced back and forth. He tried to focus on the one at the bottom, but it was too big to take in. What's this, then? His Imperial Lordship's bar bill, said the barman. Don't be daft. No one can drink that much. I'm not paying. I'm including breakages, mind you. Yeah, like what? The barman pulled a heavy hickory stick from its hiding place under the bar. Arms, legs, suit yourself, he said. Oh, come on, Ron. You've known me for years. Yes, Fred. You've always been a good customer. So what I'll do is I'll let you shut your eyes first. But that's all the money I've got. The barman grinned. Lucky one for you, eh? Cheery Little Bottom leaned against the corridor wall outside her privy and wheezed. It was something alchemists learned to do early in their career. As her tutors had said, there were two signs of a good alchemist, the athletic and the intellectual. A good alchemist of the first sort was someone who could leap over the bench and be on the far side of a safely thick wall in three seconds, and a good alchemist of the second sort was someone who knew exactly when to do this. The equipment didn't help. She scrounged what she could from the guild, but a real alchemical laboratory should be full of the kind of glassware that looked as if it were produced during the Guild of Glassblowers' all-comers hiccuping contest. A proper alchemist did not have to run tests, using as her beaker a mug with a picture of a teddy bear on it, which Corporal Nobbs was probably going to be very upset about when he found it missing. When she judged that the fumes had cleared, she ventured back into her tiny room. That was another thing. Her books on alchemy were marvellous objects, every page a work of the engraver's art, but they nowhere contained instructions like, be sure to open a window. They did have instructions like, add aqua queermis to the zinc until rising gas use vigorously evolved. But never added, don't do this at home, or even, and say fare thee well to thy eyebrows. Anyway. The glassware remained innocent of the brown-black sheen that, according to the compound of alchemy, would indicate arsenic in the sample. She'd tried every type of food and drink she could find in the palace pantries, and pressed into service every bottle and jar she could discover in the watchhouse. She tried one more time with what said on the packet it was sample two. Looked like a smear of cheese. Cheese? The various fumes thronging around her head were making her slow. She must have taken some cheese samples. She was pretty sure sample 17 had been some Lancre blue vein, which had reacted vigorously with the acid, blown a small hole in the ceiling, and covered half the workbench with a dark green substance that was setting like tar. She tested this one anyway. A few minutes later she was scrabbling furiously through her notebook. The first sample she'd taken from the pantry, one portion of duck pâté, was down here as sample 3. What about samples 1 and 2? No, sample one had been the white clay from Misbegot Bridge, so what had been two? She found it. But that couldn't be right. She looked up at the glass tube. Metallic arsenic grinned back at her. She'd retained a bit of the sample. She could test again, but perhaps it would be better to tell someone. She hurried along to the main office where a troll was on duty. Where's Commander Vimes? The troll grinned. In the gleam, little bottom. Thank you. The troll turned back to address a worried-looking monk in a brown cassock. And, he said, Best if he tells it himself, said the monk. I only work on the next bench. He put a small jar of dust on the desk. It had a bow tie around it.
I want to complain most emphatically, said the dust in a shrill little voice. I was working there only five minutes and then splash. It's going to take days to get back into shape. Working where? said the troll. None such ecclesiastical supplies, said the worried monk helpfully. Holy water section, said the vampire. You found arsenic, said Vyant. Yes, sir, lots. The sample's full of it, but... Well, Cheery looked at her feet. I tried my process again with a test sample, sir, and I'm sure I'm doing it right. Good. What was it in? That's just it, sir. It wasn't in anything from the palace, because I'd got a bit confused and tested the stuff I found under Father Tubalcheck's fingernails, sir. What? There was grease under his nails, sir, and I thought maybe it could have come from whoever attacked him. Off an apron or something. I've still got some left if you want a second opinion, sir. I wouldn't blame you. Why would the old man be handling poison? said Carrot. I thought he might have scratched the murderer, said Cheery. You know, put up a fight. With the arsenic monster, said Angua. Oh, gods, said Vimes. What time is it? Bingly, bingly, beep, bong. Oh, damn. It's nine of the clock, said the organiser, poking its head out of Vimes's pocket. I was unhappy because I had no shoes until I met a man with no feet. The watchman exchanged glances. What? said Vimes very carefully. People like it if I occasionally come up with a little aphorism or inspiring thought for the day, said the imp. So, how did you meet this man with no feet? said Vimes. I didn't actually meet him, said the imp. It was a general metaphorical statement. Well, that's it then, said Vimes. If you'd met him, you could have asked him if he had any boots he didn't have any use for. There was a squeak as he pushed the imp back into its box. There's more, sir, said Cheery. Go on, said Vimes wearily. And I had a careful look at the clay we found at the murder scene, said Cheery. Igneous said it had a lot of grog in it, old powdered pottery. Well... I chipped a bit off Dorful to compare, and I can't be sure, but I got the iconograph demon to paint really small details, and I think there's some clay just like his in there. He's got a lot of iron oxide in his clay. Vimes sighed. All around them people were drinking alcohol. One drink would make it all so clear. Any of you know what any of this means, he said. Carrot and Angua shook their heads. Is it supposed to make sense if we know how all the pieces fit together? Vimes demanded, raising his voice. Like pieces of a jigsaw, sir, Cheery ventured. Yes, said Vimes, so loudly that the room went quiet. Now all we need is the corner bit with the piece of sky and the leaves, and it'll all be one big picture. It's been a long day for all of us, sir, said Carrot. Vimes sagged. OK, he said. Tomorrow I want you, Carrot, to check on the golems in the city. If they're up to something, I want to know what it is. And you, Little Bottom... You look everywhere in the old man's house for more arsenic. I wish I could believe that you'll find any. Angua had volunteered to walk Littlebottom back to her lodgings. The dwarf was surprised that the men let her do this. After all, it had mean that Angua would then have to walk on home by herself. Aren't you afraid? Cheery said as they ambled through the damp clouds of fog. Nope. But I imagine muggers and cutthroats would be out in a fog like this, and you said you lived in the shades. Oh, yes, but I haven't been bothered lately. Ah, perhaps they're frightened of the uniform. Possibly, said Angua. Probably they've learned respect. You may be right. Er, uh, excuse me, but are you and Captain Carrot? Angua waited politely. Ah. Uh, oh, yes, said Angua, taking pity. We're, uh, uh, but I stay at Mrs. Kate's boarding house because you need your own space in a city like this. And an understanding landlady sympathetic to those with special needs, she added to herself, like door handles that a poor could operate, and a window left open on moonlit nights. You've got to have somewhere where you can be yourself. Anyway, the watch house smells of socks. I'm staying with my Uncle Armstrangler, said Cheery. It's not very nice there. People talk about mining most of the time. Don't you? There's not a lot you can say about mining. I mine in my mine, and what's mine is mine, said Cheery in a sing-song voice. And then they go on about gold, which, frankly, is a lot duller than people think. I thought dwarfs loved gold, said Angua. They just say that to get it into bed. Are you sure you're a dwarf? Sorry, that was a joke. 
There must be more interesting things. Hair, clothes, people. Good grief, you mean girl talk? I don't know, I've never talked girl talk before, said Cheery. Dwarfs just talk. Uh, it's like that in the watch, too, said Angua. You can be any sex you like, provided you act male. There's no men and women in the watch, just a bunch of lads. You'll soon learn the language. Basically, it's how much beer you supped last night, how strong the curry was you had afterwards, and where you were sick. Just think egotistical. You'll soon get the hang of it, and you'll have to be prepared for sexually explicit jokes in the watch house. Cheery blushed. Mind you, that seems to have ended now, said Angua. Why? Did you complain? No, after I joined in, it all seemed to stop, said Angua. And you know they didn't laugh. Not even when I did the hand gestures, too. I thought that was unfair. Mind you, some of them were quite small gestures. There's no help for it. I'll have to move out, sighed Cheery. I feel all wrong. Angua looked down at the little figure trudging along beside her. She recognized the symptoms. Everyone needed their own space, just like Angua did. And sometimes that space was inside their heads. And she liked Cheery, oddly enough. Possibly it was because of her earnestness or the fact that she was the only person apart from Carrot who didn't look slightly frightened when they talked to her. And that was because she didn't know. Angua wanted to preserve that ignorance as a small precious thing, but she could tell when someone needed a little change in their lives. We're going quite close to Elm Street, she said carefully. Just to uh, drop in for a while. I've got some stuff you could borrow. I won't be needing it, she told herself. When I go, I won't be able to carry much. Constable Downspout watched the fog. Watching was, after staying in one place, the thing he did best. But he was also good at keeping quite still. Not making any noise whatsoever was another of his best features. When it came to doing absolutely nothing at all, he was among the finest. But it was keeping completely motionless in one place that was his forty. If there was a roll call for the world champion non-movers, he wouldn't even turn up. Now, chin on his hands, he watched the fog. The clouds had settled somewhat, so that up here, six stories above the streets, it was possible to believe you were on a beach at the edge of a cold, moonlit sea. The occasional tall tower or steeple rose out of the clouds, but all sounds were muffled and pulled in on themselves. Midnight came and went. Constable Downspout watched and thought about pigeons. Constable Downspout had very few desires in life, and almost all of them involved pigeons. A group of figures lurched, staggered, or in one case rolled through the fog, like the four horsemen of a small apocalypse. One had a duck on his head, and because he was almost entirely sane except for this one strange particular, he was known as the Duck Man. One coughed and expectorated repeatedly, and hence was called Coffin Henry. One, a legless man on a small wheeled trolley, was for no apparent reason called Arnold Sideways, and the fourth for some very good reasons indeed, was called Foul Old Ron. Ron had a small greyish-brown tawny terrier on the end of a string, although in truth it would be hard for an observer to know exactly who was leading whom, and who, when push came to shove, would be the one to fold at the knees if the other one shouted, Sit! Because although trained canines as aids for those bereft of sight, and even of hearing, have frequently been used throughout the universe, Foul Old Ron was the first person ever to own a thinking brain dog. The beggars, led by the dog, were heading for the dark arch of Misbegot Bridge, which they called Home. At least one of them called it Home. The others respectively called it Hark, 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 Me. <laughs> Whoops. And Bugger it, Millennium, Hand and Shrimp. <sighs> As they stumbled along the riverside, they passed a can from hand to hand, drinking appreciatively and occasionally belching. The dog stopped. The beggars shunted to a halt behind it. A figure came towards them along the riverside. He goes, Tee! The beggars flung themselves against a wall as the pale figure lurched past. It was clutching at its head, as if trying to lift itself off the ground by its ears, and then occasionally banging its head against nearby buildings. While they watched, it pulled a metal mooring post out of the cobbles and started to hit itself over the head. Eventually the cast iron shattered. The figure dropped the stub, flung back its head, opened a mouth from which red light spilled, and roared like a bull in distress. Then it staggered on into the darkness. Eh, that's a golem again, said the duck man, the white one. 
<laughs> I get heads like that myself some mornings, said Arnold sideways. <laughs> I knows about golems, <laughs> said Coffin Henry, spitting expertly and hitting a beetle climbing the wall twenty feet away. They ain't supposed to have a voice. <laughs> Bugger it, <sighs> said foul old Ron. Dang the twigger for a bang in the fussle on shrimp. Because <laughs> the worm's on the other boot. <laughs> See if he don't. He meant it's the same one we saw the other day, said the dog, after that old priest got topped. Do you think we should tell someone? said the duck man. The dog shook its head. Nah, it said. We've got a cushy number down here, no sense in spoiling it. The five of them staggered on into the damp shadows. <laughs> I hate bloody golems taking our jobs. <laughs> we ain't got jobs. See what I mean? <laughs> What's for supper? Mud and old boots. <laughs> Millennium hand and shrimp, I says. <laughs> mm, glad I got a voice. I could speak up for myself. It's time you fed your duck. What duck? The fog glowed and sizzled around five and seven yard. Flames roared up and all but set the thick clouds alight. Spitting liquid iron cooled in its moulds. Hammers rang out around the workshops. The ironmasters didn't work by the clock, but by the more demanding physics of molten metal. Even though it was nearly midnight, strong in the arms iron founders, beaters, and general forging were still bustling. There were many strong in the arms in Ankh-Morpork. Pork. It was a very common dwarf name. That had been a major consideration for Thomas Smith when he'd adopted it by official deed poll. The scowling dwarf holding a hammer which adorned his sign was a mere figment of the sign painter's imagination. People thought dwarf made was better, and Thomas Smith had decided not to argue. The Committee for Equal Heights had objected, but things had mired somewhat, because firstly, most of the actual committee was human, since dwarfs were generally too busy to worry about that sort of thing, and for the most part were unconcerned about matters of height. There's a dwarfish saying, all trees are felled at ground level, although this is said to be an excessively bodlerized translation for a saw which more literally means, when his hands are higher than your head, his groin is level with your teeth. And in any case, their position hinged on pointing out that Mr. Strong in the arm, nay, Smith, was too tall, which was clearly a sizist discrimination and technically illegal under the committee's own rules. In the meantime, Thomas had let his beard grow, wore an iron helmet if he thought anyone official was around, and put up his prices by twenty pence on the dollar. The drop hammers thumped, all in a row, powered by the big ox treadmill. There were swords to beat out and panels to be shaped. Sparks erupted. Strong in the arm took off his helmet, the committee had been around again, and wiped the inside. Dibbuk, where the hell are you? A sensation of filled space made him turn. The foundry's golem was standing a few inches behind him, the forge light glowing on his dark red clay. I told you not to do that, didn't I? Strong in the arm shouted above the din. The golem held up its slate. Yes. You've gone and done all your holy day stuff. You were away too long. Sorrow. Well, now you're back with us. Go and take over on number three, Hammer, and send Mr. Vincent up to my office, right? Yes. Strong in the arm, climbed the stairs to his office. He turned at the top to look back across the red-lit foundry floor. He saw Dibbuk walk over to the hammer and hold up a slate for the foreman. He saw Vincent, the foreman, walk away. He saw Dibbuk take the sword blank that was being shaped and hold it in place for a few blows then hurl it aside. Strong in the arm hurried back down the steps. When he was halfway down, Dibbuk had laid his head on the anvil. When Strong in the arm reached the bottom, the hammer struck for the first time. When he was halfway across the ash-crusted floor, other workers scurrying after him, the hammer struck for the second time. As he reached Dibbuk, the hammer struck for the third time. The glow faded in the golem's eyes. A crack appeared across the impassive face. The hammer went back up for the fourth time. Dark! screamed Strong in the arm and then there was nothing but pottery. When the thunder had died away, the foundry master got to his feet and brushed himself off. Dust and wreckage were strewn across the floor. The hammer had jumped its bearings and was lying by the anvil in a heap of golem shards. Strong in the arm gingerly picked up a piece of a foot, tossed it aside, and then reached down again and pulled a slate out of the wreckage. He read, The old men helped us. Thou shalt not kill Clay of my clay, shame, sorrow.
His foreman looked over Strong in the arm's shoulder. What did he go and do that for? How should I know? snapped Strong in the arm. I mean, it brought the tea round this afternoon as normal as anything, then it went off for a couple of hours and now this. Strong in the arm shrugged. A golem was a golem, and that was all there was to it, but the recollection of that bland face positioning itself under the giant hammer had shaken him. I heard the other day the sawmill in Dimwell Street wouldn't mind selling the one it's got, said the foreman. It's sawed up a mahogany trunk into matchsticks or something. You want I should go and have a word? Strong in the arm looked at the slate again. Dibberg had never been very wordy. He'd carry red-hot iron, hammer sword blanks with his fists, clean out clinkers from a smelter still too hot for a man to touch, and never say a word. Of course, he couldn't say any words, but Dibberg had always given the impression that there were none he'd particularly wanted to say in any case. He just worked. These were the most words he'd ever written at any one time. They spoke to Strong in the arm of black distress, and a mind that would have been screaming if it could only have uttered a sound, which was daft. The things couldn't commit suicide. Boss, said the foreman, I said you want me to get another one? Strong in the arm skimmed the slate away, and with a feeling of relief watched it shatter against the wall. No, he said, just clear things up and get the bloody hammer fixed. Sergeant Colon, after some considerable effort, managed to get his head higher than the gutter. Yeah, you're right, Corporal Lord de Nobbs, he mumbled. Dunno, Fred, whose face is this? It's my nobby. Thank God for that. I thought it was me. Colon fell back. We're lying in the gutter, Nobby, he moaned. Oh, we're all lying in the gutter, Fred, but some of us are looking at the stars. Well, I'm looking at your face, Nobby. Stars would be a lot better, believe you me. Come on. With several false starts, they both managed to get upright, mainly by pulling themselves up one another. Where, where, where are we, Nobby? I'm sure we left the drum. I've got a sheet over my head. It's the fog, Nobby. What about these uh, legs down here? I reckon them's your legs, Nobby. I've got mine. Right, right. I reckon I drunk a lot, Sarge. Drunk as a lord, eh? Nobby reached gingerly up to his helmet. Someone had put a paper coronet around it. His questing hand found a dog end behind his ear. It was the unpleasant hour of the drinking day when, after a few hours' quality gutter time, you're beginning to feel the retribution of sobriety while still being drunk enough to make it worse. How do we get here, Sarge? Colon started to scratch his head and stopped because of the noise. I reckon, he said, winnowing the frazzled shreds of his short-term memory, I reckon seems to me there was something about storming the palace and demanding your birthright. Nobby choked and spat out the cigarette. We didn't do that, did we? You were shouting we ought to do it. Oh, gods, moaned Nobby. But I reckon you threw up around that time. That's a relief anyway. Well, it was all over Grabber Hoskins, but he tripped over someone before he could get us. Colon suddenly patted his pockets. And I've still got the tea money, he said. Another cloud of memory scudded across the sunshine of oblivion. Well, three pennies of it. The urgency of this got through to Nobby. Threepence? Yeah, well, after you started ordering all them expensive drinks for the old bar, well, you didn't have no money, and it was either me paying for them or... or... Colon moved his finger across his throat and went... <coughs> you telling me we paid for happy hour in the tram? Not so much happy hour, said Colon, miserably. More sort of ecstatic 150 minutes. I didn't even know you could buy gin in paints. Nobby tried to focus on the fog. No one can drink gin by the pint, Sarge. That's what I kept saying. And would you listen? Nobby sniffed. We're close to the river, he said. Let's try to get... Something roared very close by. It was long and low, like a foghorn in serious distress. It was the sound you might hear from a cattle yard on a nervous night, and it went on and on, and then stopped so abruptly it caught the silence unawares. "'Far away from that as we can,' said Nobby. The sound had done the work of an ice-cold shower and about two pints of black coffee. Colon spun round. He desperately needed something that would do the work of a laundry. "'Where did it come from?' he said. 
It was over there, wasn't it? I thought it was that way. In the fog, all directions were the same. I think, said Colin slowly, that we ought to go and make a report about this as soon as possible. Right, said Nobby. Which way? Let's just run, eh? Constable Downspout's huge pointy ears quivered as the noise boomed over the city. He turned his head carefully, triangulating for height, direction, and distance. And then he remembered it. The cry was heard in the watchhouse, but muffled by the fog. It entered the open head of the golem dwarfel and bounced around inside, echoing down, down among the small cracks in the clay, until, at the very edge of perception, little grains danced together. The sightless sockets stared at the wall. No one heard the cry that came back from the dead skull, because there was no mouth to utter it, and not even a mind to guide it, but it screamed out into the night. Clay of my clay, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not die. Samuel Vimes dreamed about clues. He had a jaundiced view of clues. He instinctively distrusted them. They got in the way. And he distrusted the kind of person who'd take one look at another man and say in a lordly voice to his companion, Ah, my dear sir, I can tell you nothing except that he is a left-handed stonemason who has spent some years in the merchant navy and has recently fallen on hard times. And then unroll a lot of supercilious commentary about calluses and stance and the state of a man's boots, when exactly the same comments could apply to a man who was wearing his old clothes because he'd been doing a spot of home bricklaying for a new barbecue pit and had been tattooed once when he was drunk and seventeen, these terms are often synonymous, and in fact got seasick on a wet pavement. What arrogance! What an insult to the rich and chaotic variety of the human experience! It was the same with more static evidence. The footprints in the flowerbed were probably, in the real world, left by the window cleaner. The scream in the night was quite likely a man getting out of bed and stepping sharply on an upturned hairbrush. The real world was far too real to leave neat little hints. It was full of too many things. It wasn't by eliminating the impossible that you got at the truth, however improbable. It was by the much harder process of eliminating the possibilities. You worked away, patiently asking questions and looking hard at things. You walked and talked, and in your heart you just hoped like hell that some bugger's nerve would crack and he'd give himself up. The events of the day clanged together in Vimes's head. Golems tramped like sad shadows. Father Tubalcheck waved at him, and then his head exploded, showering Vimes in words. Mr. Hopkinson lay dead in his own oven, a slice of dwarf bread in his mouth, and the golems marched on silently. There was Dorful dragging its foot, its head open for the words to fly in and out of, like a swarm of bees, and in the middle of it all, Arsenic danced, a spiky little green man, crackling and gibbering. At one point he thought one of the golems screamed. After that, the dream faded a bit at a time. Golems, oven, words, priest, dorful, golems marching, the thudding of their feet making the whole dream pulsate. Vimes opened his eyes. Beside him, Lady Sybil said, and turned over. Someone was hammering at the front door. Still muzzy, head swimming, Vimes pulled himself up on his elbows and said to the nighttime world in general, What sort of a time do you call this? Bingly bingly deep, said a cheerful voice from the direction of Vimes's dressing table. Oh, please. Twenty-nine minutes and thirty-one seconds past five a.m. A penny saved is a penny earned. Would you like me to present your schedule for today? While I am doing this, why not take some time to fill out your registration card? What? What? What are you talking about? The knocking continued. Vimes fell out of bed and groped in the dark for the matches. He finally got a candle alight, and half ran, half staggered down the long stairs and into the hall. The knocker turned out to be Constable Visit. It's Lord Vetinari, sir. It's worse this time. Has anyone sent for Donut Jimmy? Yes, sir. At this time of day, the fog was fighting a rearguard action against the dawn, and made the whole world look as though it were inside a ping-pong ball. I poked my head in as soon as I came on shift, and he was out like a light, sir. How did you know he wasn't asleep? On the floor, sir, with all his clothes on. A couple of watchmen had put the patrician on his bed by the time Vimes arrived, slightly out of breath and with his knees aching. Gods, he thought, as he struggled up the stairs, it's not like the old truncheon and bell days. You wouldn't think twice about running halfway across the city, coppers and criminals locked in hot pursuit. 
With a mixture of pride and shame, he added, and none of the buggers ever caught me either. The patrician was still breathing, but his face was waxy, and he looked as though death might be an improvement. Vimes's gaze roamed the room. There was a familiar haze in the air. Who opened the window? he demanded. I did, sir, said Visit, just before I went to get you. He looked as though he needed some fresh air. It'd be fresher if you left the window shut, said Vimes. OK, I want everyone, I mean everyone, who was in this place overnight, rounded up and down in the hall in two minutes, and someone fetch Corporal Littlebottom, and tell Captain Carrot. I'm worried and confused, he thought, so the first rule in the book is to spread it around. He prowled around the room. It didn't take much intelligence to see that Vetinari had got up and moved over to his writing desk, where, by the look of it, he had worked for some time. The candle had burned right down. An inkwell had been overturned, presumably when he'd slipped off the chair. Vimes dipped a finger in the ink and sniffed it. Then he reached for the quill pen beside it, hesitated, took out his dagger and lifted the long feather gingerly. There seemed to be no cunning little barbs on it, but he put it carefully on one side for Littlebottom to examine later. He glanced down at the paper Vetinari had been working on. To his surprise, it wasn't writing at all, but a careful drawing— it showed a striding figure, except that the figure was not one person at all, but made up of thousands of smaller figures. The effect was like one of the wicker men built by some of the more outlandish tribes near the hub, when they annually celebrated the great cycle of nature and their reverence for life by piling as much of it as possible in a great heap and setting fire to it. The composite man was wearing a crown. Vimes pushed the sheet of paper aside and returned his attention to the desk. He brushed the surface carefully for any suspicious splinters. He crouched down and examined the underside. The light was growing outside. Vimes went into both the rooms alongside and made sure their drapes were open, and then went back into Vetinari's room, closed the curtains and the doors, and sidled along the walls looking for any telltale speck of light that might indicate a small hole. Where could you stop? Splinters in the floor? Blowpipes through the keyhole? He opened the curtains again. Vetinari had been on the mend yesterday, and now he looked worse. Someone had got to him in the night. How? Slow poison was the devil of a thing. You had to find a way of giving it to the victim every day. No, you didn't. What was elegant was finding a way of getting him to administer it to himself every day. Vimes rummaged through the paperwork. Vetinari had obviously felt well enough to get up and walk over here, but here was where he had collapsed. You couldn't poison a splinter or a nail because he wouldn't keep on nicking himself. There was a book half buried in the papers, but it had a lot of bookmarks in it, mostly torn bits of old letters. What did he do every day? Vimes opened the book. Every page was covered with handwritten symbols. You have to get a poison like arsenic into the body. It isn't enough to touch it. Or is it? Is there a kind of arsenic you can pick up through the skin? No one was getting in. Vimes was almost certain of that. The food and drink were probably all right, but he'd get detritus to go and have another one of his little talks with the cooks in any case. Something he breathed? How could you keep that up day after day without arousing suspicion somewhere? Anyway, you'd have to get your poison into the room. Something already in the room. Cheery had a different carpet put down and replaced the bed. What else could you do? Strip the paint from the ceiling? What had Betanari told Cheery about poisoning? You put it where no one will look at all. Vimes realized he was still staring at the book. There wasn't anything there that he could recognize. It must be a code of some sort. Knowing Vetinari, it wouldn't be crackable by anyone in a normal frame of mind. Could you poison a book? But so what? There were other books. You'd have to know he'd look at this one continuously. And even then, you'd have to get the poison into him. A man might prick his finger once, and after that he'd take care. It sometimes worried Vimes the way he suspected everything. If you started wondering whether a man could be poisoned by words, you might as well accuse the wallpaper of driving him mad. Mind you, that horrible green colour could drive anyone insane. Bingley beep beep bleep. Oh, no. This is your 6 a.m. wake-up call. Good morning. Here are your appointments for today. Insert name here, 10 a.m. Shut up. Listen, whatever's in my diary for today is definitely not. Vimes stopped. He lowered the box. He went back to the desk. If you assumed one page per day, Lord Vetinari had a very good memory.
But everyone wrote things down, didn't they? You couldn't remember every little thing. Wednesday, 3 p.m., Reign of Terror, 3.15 p.m., Clean Out Scorpion Pit. He held the organizer up to his lips. Take a memo, he said. Hooray! Go right ahead. Don't forget to say memo first. Speak to... Oh, blast. Memo. What about Veterinary's journal? Is that it? Yes. Someone knocked politely at the door. Vimes opened it carefully. Oh, it's you, Little Bottom. Vimes blinked. Something wasn't right about the dwarf. I'll mix up some of Mr. Donut's jollop right away, sir. The dwarf looked past Vimes to the bed. Ooh, he doesn't look good, does he? Get someone to move him into a different bedroom, said Vimes. Get the servants to prepare a new room, right? Yes, sir. And after they've done it, pick a different room at random and move him into it, and change everything, understand? Every stick of furniture, every vase, every rug. Uh, yes, sir. Vimes hesitated. Now he could put his finger on what had been bothering him for the last twenty seconds. Little Bottom. Sir? You, uh, you, on your ears? Earrings, sir, said Cheery nervously. Constable Angua gave them to me. Really? Uh, right. I didn't think dwarfs wore jewellery, that's all. We're known for rings, sir. Yes, of course. Rings, yes. No one quite like a dwarf for forging a magical ring, but... Magical earrings? Oh, well. There were some waters too deep to wade. Sergeant Detritus's approach to these matters was almost instinctively correct. He had the palace staff lined up in front of him and was shouting at them at the top of his voice. Look at old Detritus, Vimes thought as he went down the stairs. Just your basic thick troll a few years ago, now a valuable member of the watch, provided you get him to repeat his orders back to you to make sure he understands you. His armour gleams even brighter than carrots because he doesn't get bored with polishing. And he's mastered policing as it is practised by the majority of forces in the universe, which is basically screaming angrily at people until they give in. The only reason that he's not a one-troll reign of terror is the ease with which his thought processes can be derailed by anyone who tries something fiendishly cunning like an outright denial. I know you all done it, he was shouting. If the person what done it does not own up, the whole staff, and I mean this, the whole staff will be locked up in the tanti, also we throws the key away. He pointed a finger at a stout scullery maid. It was you what done it, own up. No. Detritus paused. Then, where was you last night? Own up. In bed, of course. Aha! Uh -huh. That's a likely story. Own up. That where you always is at night? Of course. Ha <laughs> ha Own up. You got witnesses? Sauce. Ah, so you got no witnesses. You done it then. Own up. No. Oh. All right, all right. Thank you, Sergeant. That will be all for now, said Vimes, patting him on the shoulder. Are all the staff here? He glared at the line-up. Well, are you all here? There was a certain amount of reluctant shuffling among the ranks, and then someone cautiously put up a hand. M Mildred Easy hasn't been seen since yesterday, said its owner. She's the upstairs maid. A boy come with a message. She had to go off to see her family. Vimes felt the faintest prickles on the back of his neck. Anyone know why, he said. Dunno, sir. She left all her stuff. All right. Sergeant, before you go off shift, get someone to find her and then go and get some sleep. The rest of you, go and get on with whatever it is you do. Ah, Mr. Drumnot. The patrician's personal clerk, who'd been watching Detritus's technique with a horrified expression, looked up at him. Yes, Commander? What's this book? Is it his lordship's diary? Drumnot took the book. It looks like it, certainly. Have you been able to crack the code? I didn't know it was in code, Commander. What? You've never looked at it? Why should I, sir? It's not mine. You do know his last secretary tried to kill him? Yes, sir. I ought to say, sir, that I have already been exhaustively interrogated by your men. The Drumnot opened the book and raised his eyebrows. What did they say? said Vimes. Drumnot looked up thoughtfully. Let me see now. It was you what done it, own up. Everybody seen you. We got lots of people say you done it. You done it all right, didn't you? Own up. That was, I think, the, the, the general approach. And then I said it wasn't me, and that seems to puzzle the officer concerned. 
Drumnot delicately licked his fingers and turned a page. Vimes stared at him. The sound of saws was brisk on the morning air. Captain Carrot knocked against the timber yard door, which was eventually opened. Good morning, sir, he said. I understand you have a golem here. Had, said the timber merchant. Oh dear, another one, said Angua. That made four so far. The one in the foundry had knelt under a hammer. The one in the stonemason's yard was now ten clay toes sticking out from under a two-ton block of limestone. One working in the docks had last been seen in the river, striding towards the sea, and now this one. It was weird, said the merchant, thumping the golem's chest. Sidney said it went on sawing all the way up to the moment it sawed its head right off. I've got a load of ash planking got to go out this afternoon. Who's going to saw it up, may I ask? Angua picked up the golem's head. Insofar as it had any expression at all, it was one of intense concentration. Here, yeah, said the merchant. Alf told me he heard in the drum last night that golems have been murdering people. Inquiries are continuing, said Carrot. Now then, Mr. It's Preble Skink, isn't it? Your brother runs the lamp oil shop in Cable Street, and your daughter is a maid at the university. The man looked astonished, but Carrot knew everyone. Yeah. Did your golem leave the yard yesterday evening? Well, early on, something about a holy day. He looked nervously from one to the other. You've got to let them go, otherwise the word's in their heads. And then it came back and worked all night? Yeah, what else would it do? And then Alf came in on early turn, and he said it came up out of the saw pit, stood there for a moment, and then... Was it sawing pine logs yesterday? said Angua. That's right. Where am I going to get another golem at short notice, may I ask? What's this? said Angua. She picked up a wood-framed square from the heap of sawdust. This was its slate, was it? She handed it to Carrot. Thou shalt not kill, Carrot read slowly. Clay of my clay ashamed. Do you have any idea why it had write that? Search me, said Skink. They're always doing dumb things. He brightened up a bit. Hey, perhaps it went potty. <laughs> Get it? Clay? Pot? Potty? Extremely funny, said Carrot gravely. I will take this as evidence. Good morning. Why did you ask about pine logs, he said to Angua as they stepped outside. I smelled the same pine resin in the cellar. Pine resin's just pine resin, isn't it? No, not to me. That golem was in there. They all were, sighed Carrot, and now they're committing suicide. You can't take life you haven't got, said Angua. What shall we call it, then? Destruction of property, said Carrot. Anyway, we can't ask them now, he tapped the slate. They've given us the answers, he said. Perhaps we can find out what the questions should have been. What do you mean, nothing, said Vimes. It's got to be the book. He licks his fingers to turn a page, and every day he gets a little dose of arsenic. Fiendishly clever. Sorry, sir, said Cheery, backing away. I can't find a trace. I've used all the tests I know. You sure? I could send it up to the Unseen University. They've built a new morphic resonator in the High Energy Magic Building. Magic would easily... Don't do that, said Vimes. We'll keep the wizards out of this. Damn, for half an hour there I really thought I'd got it. He sat down at his desk. Something new was odd about the dwarf, but again he couldn't quite work out what it was. We're missing something here, Little Bottom, he said. Yes, sir. Let's look at the facts. If you want to poison someone slowly, you've either got to give them small doses all the time, or at least every day. We've covered everything the patrician does. It can't be the air in the room. You and I have been in there every day. It's not the food, we're pretty sure of that. Is something stinging him? Can you poison a wasp? What we need... Excuse me, sir! Vimes turned. Detritus, I thought you were off duty. I got them to give me the address of that maid called Easy, like you said, said Detritus stoically. I went up there and there was people all looking in. What do you mean? Neighbours and that, crying women all around the door, and I remember what you said about that diplo word. Diplomacy, said Vimes. Yeah, not shouting at people and that. I thought, this looks a delicate situation. Also, they was throwing stuff at me. So I come back here, I write down the address, and now I'm going home. He saluted, rocked slightly from the force of the blow to the side of his head, and departed. Thanks, Detritus, said Vimes. He looked at the paper written in the troll's big, round hand. 
First floor, back, 27 Cockbill Street, he said. Good grief. You know it, sir? Should do. I was born in that street, said Vimes. It's down below the shades. Easy. Easy. Yes, now I remember there was a Mrs. Easy down the road. Skinny woman, did a lot of sewing, big family. Well, we were all big families. It was the only way to keep warm. He frowned at the paper. It wasn't as if it were any particular lead. Maid servants were always going off to see their mothers, every time there was the least little family upset. What was it his granny had used to say? Yes, sons, yes, son, Chilly takes a wife, but your daughter's your daughter all her life. Sending a watchman around would almost certainly be a waste of everyone's time. Well, well, Cockbill Street, he said. He stared at the paper again. You might as well rename the place Memory Lane. No, you couldn't waste watch resources on a wild goose chase like that. But he might look in, on his way past. Sometime today. Uh, little bottom, sir? On your lips, sir. Uh, red, uh, on, on your lips. Lipstick, sir. Oh, uh, lipstick. Mm, fine, lipstick. Constable Angua gave it to me, sir. That was kind of her, said Vimes. I expect. It was called the Rat's Chamber. In theory, this was because of the decoration. Some former resident of the palace had thought that a fresco of dancing rats would be a real decorative coup. There was a pattern of rats woven in the carpet. On the ceiling, rats danced in a circle, their tails intertwining at the centre. After half an hour in that room, most people wanted a wash. Soon, then, there would be a big rush on the hot water. The room was filling up fast. By common consent, the chair was taken and amply filled by Mrs. Rosemary Palm, head of the Guild of Seamstresses, as they were euphemistically named. People said they call themselves seamstresses, ahem, ahem, as one of the most senior guild leaders. Quiet, please, gentlemen. The noise level subsided a little. Dr. Downey, she said. The head of the Assassin's Guild nodded. My friends, I think we are all aware of the situation, he began. Yeah, so's your accountant, said a voice in the crowd. There was a ripple of nervous laughter, but it didn't last long, because you don't laugh too loud at someone who knows exactly how much you're worth dead. Dr. Downey smiled. I can assure you once again, gentlemen and ladies, that I am aware of no engagement regarding Lord Vetinari. In any case, I cannot imagine that an assassin would use poison in this case. His lordship spent some time at the assassin's school. He knows the uses of caution. No doubt he will recover. And if he doesn't, said Mrs. Palm, no one lives forever, said Dr. Downey, in the calm voice of a man who personally knew this to be true. Then, no doubt, we'll get a new ruler. The room went very silent. The word, who, hovered silently above every head. The thing is, the thing is, said Gerhard Sock, head of the Butcher's Guild, it's been, you've got to admit it, it's been, well, think about some of the others. The words, Lord Snapcase, now, at least this one isn't actually insane, flickered in the group consciousness. I have to admit, said Mrs. Palm, that under Vetinari it has certainly been safer to walk the streets. You should know, madam, said Mr. Sock. Mrs. Palm gave him an icy look. There were a few sniggers. I meant that a modest payment to the Thieves' Guild is all that is required for perfect safety, she finished. And indeed a man may visit a house of ill-negotiable hospitality, said Mrs. Palm quickly, indeed, and be quite confident of not waking up stripped stark naked and beaten black and blue, said Sock. Unless his tastes run that way, said Mrs. Palm, we aim to give satisfaction, very accurately if required. Life has certainly been more reliable under Vetinari, said Mr. Potts of the Baker's Guild. He does have all straight theatre players and mime artists thrown into Scorpion Pit, said Mr. Boggess of the Thieves' Guild. True, but let's not forget that he has his bad points, too. The man is capricious. You think so? Compared to the ones we had before, he's as reliable as a rock. Snapcase was reliable, said Mr. Sock gloomily. Remember when he made his horse a city councillor? You've got to admit he wasn't a bad councillor, compared to some of the others. 
As I recall, the others at the time were a vase of flowers, a heap of sand, and three people who had been beheaded. Remember all those fights? All the little gangs of thieves fighting all the time? It got so that there was hardly any energy left to actually steal things, said Mr. Boggess. Things are indeed more reliable now. Silence descended again. That was it, wasn't it? Things were reliable now. Whatever else you said about old Betinari, he made sure today was always followed by tomorrow. If you were murdered in your bed, at least, it would be by arrangement. Things were more exciting under Lord Snapcase, someone ventured. Yes, right up to the point when your head fell off. The trouble is, said Mr. Boggess, that the job makes people mad. You take some chap who's no worse than any of us, and after a few months sees talking to moss and having people flayed alive. Vetinari isn't mad. Depends how you look at it. No one can be as sane as he is without being mad. I am only a weak woman, said Mrs. Palm, to the personal disbelief of several present, but it does seem to me that there's an opportunity here. Either there's a long struggle to sort out a successor, or we sort it out now, yes? The guild leaders tried to look at one another while simultaneously avoiding everyone else's glances. Who'd be patrician now? Once there'd have been a huge, multi-sided power struggle, but now... You've got the power, but you've got the problems, too. Things had changed. These days you had to negotiate and juggle with all the conflicting interests. No one sane had tried to kill Vetinari for years, because the world with him in it was just preferable to the one without him. Besides, Vetinari had tamed Ark Morpork. He tamed it like a dog. He'd taken a minor scavenger among scavengers, and lengthened its teeth, and strengthened its jaws, and built up its muscles, and studded its collar, and fed it lean steak, and then he'd aimed it at the throat of the world. He'd taken all the gangs and squabbling groups, and made them see that a small slice of the cake on a regular basis was better by far than a bigger slice with a dagger in it. He'd made them see that it was better to take a small slice, but enlarge the cake. Ankh Morpork, alone of all the cities of the plains, had opened its gates to dwarfs and trolls. Alloys are stronger, Betinari had said. It had worked. They made things. Often they made trouble, but mostly they made wealth. As a result, although Ankh Morpork still had many enemies, those enemies had to finance their armies with borrowed money. Most of it was borrowed from Ankh Morpork, at punitive interest. There hadn't been any really big wars for years. Ankh Morpork had made them unprofitable. Thousands of years ago, the old empire had enforced the Pax Morporkia, which had said to the world, Do not fight, or we will kill you. The Pax had arisen again, but this time it said, If you fight, we'll call in your mortgages. And incidentally, that's my pike you're pointing at me. I paid for that shield you're holding, and take my helmet off when you speak to me, you horrible little debtor. And now the whole machine, which whirred away so quietly that people had forgotten it was a machine at all, and thought that it was just the way the world worked, had given a lurch. The guild leaders examined their thoughts and decided that what they did not want was power. What they wanted was that tomorrow should be pretty much like today. There's the dwarfs, said Mr. Boggess. Even if one of us, not that I'm saying it would be one of us, of course, even if someone took over, what about the dwarfs? We get someone like Snapcase again, there's going to be chopped kneecaps in the streets. You're not suggesting we have some sort of vote, are you? Some sort of popularity contest? Ah, oh, no, it's just, it's just all more complicated now, and power goes to people's heads. And then other people's heads fall off. I wish you wouldn't keep on saying that, whoever you are, said Mrs. Palm. Anyone would think you'd had your head cut off. Huh? Oh, it's you, Mr. Slant. I do apologise. Speaking as the president of the Guild of Lawyers, said Mr. Slant, the most respected zombie in Ankh Morpork, I must recommend stability in this matter. I wonder if I may offer some advice. How much will it cost us, said Mr. Sock. Stability, said Mr. Slant, equals monarchy. Oh, now don't tell us. Look at Clatch, said Mr. Slant doggedly. Generations of serifs result political stability. Take Pseudopolis, or Stolat, or even the Agatean Empire. Come on, said Dr. Downey. Everyone knows that kings, oh, monarchs come and go, they depose one another and so forth, said Mr. Slant, but the institution goes on. Besides, I think you'll find that it is possible to work out an accommodation. 
he realized that he had the floor. His fingers absent-mindedly touched the seam where his head had been sewn back on. All those years ago, Mr. Slant had refused to die until he had been paid for the disbursements in the matter of conducting his own defense. "'How do you mean?' said Mr. Potts. "'I accept that the question of resurrecting the Ankh-Morpork succession has been raised several times recently,' said Mr. Slant. "'Yes, by madman,' said Mr. Boggis. "'It's part of the symptoms. Put underpants on head, talk to trees, drool, decide that Ankh-Morpork needs a king.' "'Exactly. Supposing sane men were to give it consideration?' "'Go on,' said Dr. Downey. "'There have been precedents,' said Mr. Slant. "'Monarchies who have found themselves bereft of a convenient monarch have obtained one, "'some suitably born member of some other royal line. "'After all, what is required is someone who, um, knows the ropes, as I believe the saying goes.' "'Sorry, are you saying we send out for a king?' said Mr. Boggus. "'We put up some kind of advertisement. "'Throne vacant, applicant must supply own crown.' In fact, said Mr. Slant, ignoring this, I recall that during the First Empire, Genua wrote to Ankh Morpork and asked to be sent one of our generals to be their king, their own royal lines having died out through interbreeding so intensively that the last king kept trying to breed with himself. The history books say that we sent our loyal general Tacticus, whose first act after obtaining the crown was to declare war on Ankh Morpork. Kings are interchangeable. "'You mentioned something about reaching an accommodation,' said Mr. Boggus. "'You mean, we tell a king what to do?' "'I like the sound of that,' said Mrs. Palm. "'I like the echoes,' said Dr. Downey. "'Not tell,' said Mr. Slant. "'We agree. "'Obviously, as king, he would concentrate on those things traditionally associated with kingship.' "'Waving,' said Mr. Sock. "'Being gracious,' said Mrs. Palm. "'Welcoming ambassadors from foreign countries,' said Mr. Potts. "'Shaking hands? Cutting off heads? No, 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 that will not be part of his duties. Minor affairs of state will be carried out by—' "'By his advisers?' said Dr. Downey. He leaned back. "'I'm sure I can see where this is going, Mr. Slant,' he said. "'But kings once acquired are so damned hard to get rid of, acceptably. "'There have been precedents for that, too,' said Mr. Slant. The assassin's eyes narrowed. I am intrigued, Mr. Slant, that as soon as the Lord Veterinari appears to be seriously ill, you pop up with suggestions like this. It sounds like a remarkable coincidence. There is no mystery, I assure you. Destiny works its course. Surely many of you have heard the rumors that there is in this city someone with a bloodline traceable all the way back to the last royal family? Someone working in this very city in a comparatively humble position? A lowly watchman, in fact? There were some nods, but not very definite ones. They were to nods what a grunt is to yes. The guilds all picked up information. No one wanted to reveal how much or how little they personally knew, just in case they knew too little, or even worse, turned out to know too much. However, Doc Pseudopolis of the Guild of Gamblers put on a careful poker face and said, Yes, but the tricentennial is coming up, and in a few years it'll be the century of the rat. There's something about centuries that gives people a kind of fever. Nevertheless, the person exists, said Mr. Slant. The evidence stares one in the face if one looks in the right places. Very well, said Mr. Boggis. Tell us the name of this captain. He often lost large sums at poker. Captain, said Mr. Slant. I'm sorry to say his natural talents have thus far not commended him to that extent. He is a corporal. Corporal C. W. St. J. Nobbs. There was a silence. And then there was a strange putt-putting sound, like water negotiating its way through a partially blocked pipe. Queen Molly of the Beggar's Guild had so far been silent, apart from occasional damp sucking noises, as she tried to dislodge a particle of her lunch from the things which, because they were still in her mouth and apparently attached, were technically her teeth. Now she was laughing. The hairs wobbled on every wart. <laughs> Nobby knobs, she said. You're talking about Nobby knobs? He is the last known descendant of the Earl of Ankh, who could trace his descent all the way to a distant cousin to the last king, said Mr. Slant. It's the talk of the city. A picture forms in my mind, said Dr. Downey. Small, monkey-like chap, always smoking very short cigarettes. Spotty. He squeezes them in public. <laughs> that snobby, Queen Molly chuckled, face like a blind carpenter's thumb. Him? But the man's a tit. 
and dim as a penny candle, said Mr. Boggis. I don't see... Suddenly he stopped, and then contracted the contemplative silence that was gradually affecting everyone else around the table. Don't see why we shouldn't give this due consideration, he said after a while. The assembled leaders looked at the table, then they looked at the ceiling, then they studiously avoided one another's glance. Blood will out, said Mr. Carey. When I've watched him go down the street, I've always thought, there's a man who walks in greatness, said Mrs. Palm. He squeezes them in a very regal way, mind you, very graciously. The silence rolled over the assembly again, but it was busy in the same way that the silence of an anthill is busy. I must remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that poor Lord Betinari is still alive, said Mrs. Palm. Indeed, indeed, said Mr. Slant, and long may he remain so. I've merely set out for you one option against that day. May it be a long time coming when we should consider a successor. In any case, said Dr. Downey, there is no doubt that Vetinari has been overdoing it. If he survives, which is greatly to be hoped, of course, I feel we should require him to step down for the sake of his health. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, and so on. Buy him a nice house in the country somewhere, give him a pension, make sure there's a seat for him at official dinners. Obviously, if he can be so easily poisoned, now he should welcome the release from the chains of office. What about the wizards? said Mr. Boggis. They've never got involved in civic concerns, said Dr. Downey. Give them four meat meals a day and tip your hat to them and they're happy. They know nothing about politics. The silence that followed was broken by the voice of Queen Molly of the Beggars. What about vines? Dr. Downey shrugged. He is a servant of the city. That's what I mean. Surely we represent the city. <laughs> he won't see it that way. And you know what Vimes thinks about kings? It was a Vimes who chopped the head off the last one. There's a bloodline that thinks a swing of an axe can solve anything. Now, Molly, you know Vimes had probably take an axe to Vetinari if he thought he could get away with it. No love lost there, I fancy. He won't like it. That's all I tell you. Vetinari keeps Vimes wound up. No knowing what happens if he unwinds all at once. He's a public servant, snapped Dr. Downey. Queen Molly made a face which was not difficult in one so naturally well endowed, and sat back. So this is the new way of things, is it? she muttered. Lot of ordinary men sit around a table and talk, and suddenly the world's a different place. The sheep turn round and charge the shepherd. There's a soiree at Lady Silarch's house this evening, said Dr. Downey, ignoring her. I believe Nobbs is being invited. Perhaps we can meet him. Vimes told himself he was really going to inspect the progress on the new watch house in Chitling Street. Cockbill Street was just around the corner, and then he'd call in, informally. No sense in sparing a man when they were pushed anyway. What with those murders and veterinary and detritus's anti-slab crusade? He turned the corner and stopped. Nothing much had changed. That was the shocking thing. After, ooh, too many years, things had no right not to have changed. But washing lines still crisscrossed the street between the grey ancient buildings. Antique paint still peeled in the way cheap paint peeled when it had been painted on wood too old and rotten to take paint. Cockbill Street people were usually too penniless to afford decent paint, but always far too proud to use whitewash. And the place was slightly smaller than he remembered, that was all. When had he last come down here? He couldn't remember. It was beyond the shades, and up until quite recently the watch had tended to leave that area to its own unspeakable devices. Unlike the shades, though, Cockbill Street was clean, with the haunting, empty cleanliness you get when people can't afford to waste dirt. For Cockbill Street was where people lived who were worse than poor, because they didn't know how poor they were. If you asked them, they would probably say something like, Mustn't grumble, or There's far worse off than us, or We've always kept our heads above water and we don't owe nobody nout. He could hear his granny speaking, no one's too poor to buy soap. Of course, many people were, 
but in Cockbill Street they bought soap just the same. The table might not have any food on it, but by gods it was well scrubbed. That was Cockbill Street, where what you mainly ate was your pride. What a mess the world was in, Vimes reflected. Constable Visit had told him the meek would inherit it, and what had the poor devils done to deserve that? Cockbill Street people would stand aside to let the meek through, for what kept them in Cockbill Street, mentally and physically, was their vague comprehension that there were rules, and they went through life filled with a quiet, distracted dread that they weren't quite obeying them. People said that there was one law for the rich and one law for the poor, but it wasn't true. There was no law for those who made the law, and no law for the incorrigibly lawless. All the laws and rules were for those people stupid enough to think like Cockbill Street people. It was oddly quiet. Normally there'd be swarms of kids and carts heading down towards the docks, but today the place had a shut-in look. In the middle of the road was a chalked hopscotch path. Vimes felt his knees go weak. It was still here. When had he last seen it? Thirty-five years ago? Forty? So it must have been drawn and redrawn thousands of times. He'd been pretty good at it. Of course, they'd played it by Ankh Morpork rules. Instead of kicking a stone, they'd kicked William Scuggins. It had been just one of the many inventive games they'd played which had involved kicking, chasing, or jumping on William Scuggins until he threw one of his famous wobblers and started frothing and violently attacking himself. Vimes had been able to drop William in the square of his choice nine times out of ten. The tenth time, William bit his leg. In those days, tormenting William and finding enough to eat had made for a simple, straightforward life. There weren't so many questions you didn't know the answers to, except maybe how to stop your leg festering. Sir Samuel looked around, saw the silent street, and flicked a stone out of the gutter with his foot. Then he booted it surreptitiously along the squares, adjusted his cloak, and hopped and jumped his way up, turned, hopped. What was it you shouted as you hopped? Salt, mustard, vinegar, and pepper? No. Or was it the one that went, William Scuggins is a bastard? Now he'd wonder about that all day. A door opened across the street. Vimes froze, one leg in mid-air, as two black-clothed figures came out slowly and awkwardly. This was because they were carrying a coffin. The natural solemnity of the occasion was diminished by their having to squeeze around it and out into the street, pulling the casket after them and allowing two other pairs of bearers to edge their way into the daylight. Vimes remembered himself in time to lower his other foot, and then remembered even more of himself and snatched his helmet off in respect. Another coffin emerged. It was a lot smaller. It needed only two people to carry it, and that was really one too many. As mourners trooped out behind them, Vimes fumbled in a pocket for the scrap of paper Detritus had given him. The scene was in its way funny, like the bit in a circus where the coach stops and a dozen clowns get out of it. Apartment houses round here made up for their limited number of rooms by having a large number of people occupy them. He found the paper and unfolded it. First floor, back, 27 Cockbill Street. And this was it. He'd arrived in time for a funeral. Two funerals. Looks like it's a really bad day to be a golem, said Angua. There was a pottery hand lying in the gutter. That's the third one we've seen smashed in the street. There was a crash up ahead, and a dwarf came through a window more or less horizontally. His iron helmet struck sparks as he hit the street, but the dwarf was soon up again and plunging back through the adjacent doorway. He emerged via the window a moment later, but was fielded by Carrot, who set him on his feet. Hello, Mr. Orr Smiter. Are you keeping well? And what's happening here? It's that devil Gimlet, Captain Carrot. You should be arresting him. Why? What's he done? He's been poisoning people, that's what. Carrot glanced at Angua, then back at Orsmiter. Poison, he said. That's a very serious allegation. You're telling me. I was up all night with Mrs. Orsmiter. I didn't think much about it until I came in here this morning, and then there were other people complaining. He tried to struggle out of Carrot's grip. You know what, he said. You know what? We looked in his cold room, and you know what? You know what? You know what he's been selling as meat? Tell me, said Carrot. Pork and beef. Oh, dear. And lamb. Tut, tut. Hardly any rat at all. Carrot shook his head at the duplicity of traders. And Snorri Glodson Uncleson said he had rat surprise last night and he'll swear there were chicken bones in it. Carrot let go of the dwarf. You stay here, he said to Angua, and head bowed, stepped inside Gimlet's whole food delicatessen. 
An axe spun towards him. He caught it almost absent-mindedly and tossed it casually aside. Ow! There was a melee of dwarfs around the counter. The row had already gone well past the stage when it had anything much to do with the subject in hand, and these being dwarfs now included matters of vital importance, such as whose grandfather had stolen whose grandfather's mining claim three hundred years ago, and whose axe was at whose throat right now. But there was something about Carrot's presence. The fighting gradually stopped. The fighters tried to look as if they'd just happened to be standing there. There was a sudden and general axe. What axe? Oh, this axe! Oh, I was just showing it to my friend Bjorn here. Good old Bjorn. Feel to the atmosphere. All right, said Carrot. What's all this about poison? Mr. Gimlet first. It's a diabolical lie, shouted Gimlet from somewhere under the heap. I run a wholesome restaurant. My tables are so clean you could eat your dinner off them. Carrot raised his hands to stop the outburst this caused. Someone said something about rats, he said. I told them I use only the very best rats, shouted Gimlet. Good, plump rats from the best locations. None of your latrine rubbish, and they're hard to come by, let me tell you. And when you can't get them, Mr. Gimlet, said Carrot. Gimlet paused. Carrot was hard to lie to. All right, he mumbled. Maybe when there's not enough, I might sort of plump out the stock with some chicken, maybe just a bit of beef. Huh? A bit? More voices were raised. That's right. You should see his cold room, Mr. Carrot. Yeah, he uses steak and cuts little legs in it and covers it with rat sauce. I don't know. You try to do your best at very reasonable prices, and this is the thanks you get, said Gimlet hotly. It's hard enough to make ends meet as it is. You don't even make them out of the right meat. Carrot sighed. There were no public health laws in Ark Morpork. It would be like installing smoke detectors in hell. All right, he said, but you can't get poisoned by steak. No, honestly, no, 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 shut up, all of you. No, I don't care what your mother's told you. No, 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 I want to know about this poisoning, Gimlet. Gimlet struggled to his feet. We did rat surprise last night for the Sons of Blood Axe annual dinner, he said. There was a general groan. And it was rat. He raised his voice against the complaining. You can't use anything else. Listen. You've got to have the noses poking through the pastry, all right? Some of the best rat we've had for a long time, let me tell you. And you were all ill afterwards, said Carrot, taking out his notebook. Sweating all night. Couldn't see straight. I reckon I know every knot hole on the back of the privy door. I'll write that down as a definitely, said Carrot. Was there anything else on the dinner menu? Volavants and cream of rat, said Gimlet, all hygienically prepared. How do you mean, hygienically prepared, said Carrot? The chef is under strict orders to wash his hands afterwards. The assembled dwarfs nodded. This was certainly pretty hygienic. You didn't want people going around with ratty hands. Anyway, you've all been eating here for years, said Gimlet, sensing this slight veer in his direction. This is the first time there's been any trouble, isn't it? My rats are famous. Your chicken's going to be pretty famous too, said Carrot. There was laughter this time. Even Gimlet joined in. All right, I'm sorry about the chicken. But it was that or very poor rats, and you know I only buy from wee mad Arthur. He's trustworthy, whatever else you may say about him. You just can't get better rats. Everyone knows that. That'll be wee mad Arthur in Gleam Street, said Carrot. Yes, not a mark on him most of the time. Have you got any left? One or two. Gimlet's expression changed. Yeah, you don't think he poisoned them, do you? I never did trust that little bugger. Inquiries are continuing, said Carrot. He tucked his notebook away. I'd like some rats, please. Those rats to go. He glanced at the menu, patted his pocket, and looked questioningly out through the door at Angua. You don't have to buy them, she said wearily. They're evidence. We can't defraud an innocent tradesman who may be the victim of circumstances, said Carrot. You want ketchup? said Gimlet. Only they're extra with ketchup. The funeral carriage went slowly through the streets. It looked quite expensive, but that was Cockbill Street for you. People put money by. Limes remembered that. You always put money by in Cockbill Street. You saved up for a rainy day even if it was pouring already, and you'd die of shame if people thought you could afford only a cheap funeral. Half a dozen black-clad mourners came along behind, together with perhaps a score of people who had tried at least to look respectable. Vimes followed the procession at a distance, all the way to the cemetery behind the Temple of Small Gods, 
where he lurked awkwardly among the gravestones and sombre graveyard trees while the priest mumbled on. The gods had made the people of Cockbill Street poor, honest, and provident, Vimes reflected. They might as well have hung signs saying, Kick me on their backs, and had done with it. Yet Cockbill Street people tended towards religion, at least of the less demonstrative kind. They always put a little life by for a rainy eternity. Eventually the crowd around the graves broke up and drifted away with the aimless look of people whose immediate future contains ham rolls. Vimes spotted a tearful young woman in the main group and advanced carefully. Er, uh, are you Mildred Easy? he said. She nodded. Who are you? She took in the cut of his coat and added, Sir. Was that old Mrs. Easy who used to do dressmaking? said Vimes, taking her gently aside. That's right. And the smaller coffin? That was our William. The girl looked as if she were about to cry again. Can we have a talk? said Vimes. There are some things I hope you can tell me. He hated the way his mind worked. A proper human being would have shown respect and quietly walked away. But as he'd stood among the chilly stones, a horrible apprehension had stolen over him, that almost all the answers were in place now, if only he could work out the questions. She looked around at the other mourners. They had reached the gate and were staring back curiously at the two of them. Uh, I know this isn't the right time, said Vimes, but when the kids play hopscotch in the street, what's the rhyme they sing? Salt, mustard, vinegar, pepper, isn't it? She stared at his worried grin. That's a skipping rhyme, she said coldly. When they play hopscotch, they sing Billy Skunkins is a brass stud. Who are you? I'm Commander Vimes of the Watch, said Vimes. So, Willie Scuggins would live on in the street, in disguise and in a fashion, and old Stoneface was just some guy on a bonfire. Then her tears came. It's all right, it's all right, said Vimes, as soothingly as he could. I was brought up in Cockbill Street, that's why I... I mean, I'm... I mean, I'm not here on... I'm not out to... Look, I... I know you took food home from the palace. That's all right by me. I'm not here to... Oh, damn, would you like my handkerchief? I think your one's full. Everyone does it. Yes, I know. Anyway, Cook never says nothing. She began to sob again. Yes, yes. Everyone takes a few things, said Mildred Easy. It's not like stealing. It is, thought Vimes treacherously. But I don't give a damn. And now he'd got a grip on the long copper rod and was climbing into a high place while the thunder muttered around him. The, uh, the last food you stole, uh, were given, he said. What was it? Just some blancmange and some, you know, that sort of jam made out of meat. Pate. Yes, I thought it would be a little treat. Vimes nodded. Rich, mushy food, the sort you'd give to a baby who was peaky and to a granny who hadn't got any teeth. Well, he was on the roof now. The clouds were black and threatening, and he might as well wave the lightning conductor time to ask. The wrong question, as it proved. Tell me, he said, what did Mrs. Easy die of? Let me put it like this, said Cheery. If these rats had been poisoned with lead instead of arsenic, you'd have been able to sharpen their noses and use them as a pencil. She lowered the beaker. Are you sure, said Carrot. Yes. We mad Arthur wouldn't poison rats, would he? Especially not rats that were going to be eaten. I've heard he doesn't like dwarfs much, said Angua. Yes, but business is business. No one who does a lot of business with dwarfs likes them much, and he must supply every dwarf cafe and delicatessen in the city. Maybe they ate arsenic before he caught them, said Angua. People use it as a rat poison, after all. Yes, said Carrot, in a very deliberate way. They do. You're not suggesting that Betinari tucks into a nice rat every day, said Angua. I've heard he uses rats as spies, so I don't think he uses them as elevenses, said Carrot. But it'd be nice to know where wee mad Arthur gets his from, don't you think? Commander Vimes said he was looking after the veterinary case, said Angua. But we're just finding out why Gimlet's rats are full of arsenic, said Carrot innocently. Anyway, I was going to ask Sergeant Colon to look into it. But we mad Arthur, said Angua, he's mad. Fred can take Nobby with him. I'll go and tell him. Um, cheery. Yes, Captain. You've been, uh, you've been trying to hide your face from me. Oh, did someone hit you? No, sir. Only your eyes look a bit bruised and your lips. 
I'm fine, sir, said Cheery desperately. Oh, well, if you say so. I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll look for Sergeant Colon, then. He backed out, embarrassed. That left the two of them. All girls together, thought Angua. One normal girl between the two of us, at any rate. I don't think the mascara works, Angua said. The lipstick's fine, but the mascara... I don't think so. I think I need practice. You sure you want to keep the beard? You don't mean shave? Cheery backed away. All right, all right. What about the iron helmet? It belonged to my grandmother. It's dwarfish. Fine, fine, OK. You've made a good start, anyway. Uh, what do you think of this? said Cheery, handing her a bit of paper. Angua read it. It was a list of names, although most of them were crossed out. Cheery, little bottom. Cherry. Sherry. Sherry. Lucinda, little bottom. Sherry. 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 Ah, uh, what do you think? said Cherry nervously. Lucinda, said Angua, raising her eyebrows. I've always liked the sound of the name. Sherry is nice, said Angua, and it is rather like the one you've got already. The way people spell in this town, no one will actually notice unless you point it out to them. Cheery's shoulders sagged with released tension. When you've made up your mind to shout out who you are to the world, it's a relief to know that you can do it in a whisper. Sherry, thought Angua. Now, what does that name conjure up? Does the mental picture include iron boots, iron helmet, a small worried face, and a long beard? Well, it does now. Somewhere underneath Ankh Morpork, a rat went about its business, ambling unconcernedly through the ruins of a damp cellar. It turned a corner towards the grain store it knew was up ahead, and almost walked into another rat. This one was standing on its hind legs, though, and wearing a tiny black robe and carrying a scythe. Such of its snout that could be seen was bone white. Squeak, it said. Then the vision faded and revealed a slightly smaller figure. There was nothing in the least rat-like about it apart from its size. It was human, or at least humanoid. It was dressed in rat-skin trousers, but was bare above the waist, apart from two bandoliers that crisscrossed its chest, and it was smoking a tiny cigar. It raised a very small crossbow and fired. The soul of the rat, for anything so similar in so many ways to human beings certainly has a soul, watched gloomily as the figure took its recent habitation by the tail and towed it away. Then it looked up at the death of rats. Squeak, it said. The grim squeaker nodded. Squeak. A minute later, wee mad Arthur emerged into the daylight, dragging the rat behind him. There were fifty-seven neatly lined up along the wall, but despite his name, wee mad Arthur made a point of not killing the young and the pregnant females. It's always a good idea to make sure you've got a job tomorrow. His sign was still tacked up over the hole. Wee mad Arthur, as the only insect and vermin exterminator able to meet the enemy on its own terms, found that it paid to advertise. We mad Arthur, for those little things that get you down. Rats, free. Mice, one P per ten tails. Moles, half P each. Wasps, fifty P per nest. Hornets, twenty P extra. Cockroaches and similar, by arrangement. Small fees, big jobs. Arthur took out the world's smallest notebook and a piece of pencil lead. See here, now fifty-eight skins at two a penny... City bounty for the tails at a penny per ten, and the carcasses to Gimlet at tuppence per three, the hard-driving dwarf bastard that he was. There was a moment's shadow, and then someone stamped on him. Right, said the owner of the boot. Still catching rats without a guild card, are you? Easiest ten dollars we ever earned, Sid. Let's go and— The man was lifted several inches off the ground, whirled around, and hurled against a wall. His companion stared as a streak of dust raced across his boot but reacted too late. He's gone up me trouser! Uh, he's gone up me... Uh. There was a crack. Me knee! Me knee! He's broken me knee! The man, who had been flung aside, tried to get up, but something scurried across his chest and landed astride his nose. Hey, pal, said wee mad Arthur. Can your mother sew, pal? Yeah, then get her to stitch this one. He grabbed an eyelid in each hand and thrust his head forward with pinpoint precision. There was another crack as the skulls met. The man with the broken knee tried to drag himself away, but wee mad Arthur leapt from his stunned comrade and proceeded to kick him. The kicks of a man not much more than six inches high should not hurt, but wee mad Arthur seemed to have a lot more mass than his size would allow. 
Being nutted by Arthur was like being hit by a steel ball from a slingshot. A kick seemed to have all the power of one from a large man, but very painfully concentrated, into a smaller area. You could tell them buggers at the Rat Catcher's Guild that I works for those I want and charges what I like, he said between kicks, and them shites can stop trying to persecute the small businessman. The other guild enforcer made it to the end of the alley. Arthur gave Sid a final kick and left him in the gutter. We, mad Arthur, walked back to his task, shaking his head. He worked for nothing and sold his rats for half the official rate, a heinous crime. Yet we, mad Arthur, was growing rich because the guild hadn't got its joint heads around the idea of fiscal relativity. Arthur charged a lot more for his services. A lot more, that is, from the specialised and, above all, low point of view of we mad Arthur. What Ankh Morpork had yet to understand was that the smaller you are, the more your money is worth. A dollar for a human bought a loaf of bread that was eaten in a few bites. The same dollar for wee mad Arthur bought the same sized loaf, but it was food for a week and could then be further hollowed out and used as a bedroom. The size differential problem was also responsible for his frequent drunkenness. Few publicans were prepared to sell beer by the thimbleful or had gnome-sized mugs. Wee mad Arthur had to go drinking in a swimming costume. But he liked his work. No one could clear out rats like wee mad Arthur. Old and cunning rats that knew all about traps, deadfalls and poison were helpless in the face of his attack, which was where, in fact, he often attacked. The last thing they felt was a hand gripping each of their ears, and the last thing they saw was his forehead, approaching at speed. Muttering under his breath, wee mad Arthur got back to his calculations, but not for long. He spun around, forehead cocked. It's only us, wee mad Arthur, said Sergeant Colon, stepping back hurriedly. That's Mr. Wee Mad Arthur to use, copper, said Wee Mad Arthur, but he relaxed a little. We're Sergeant Colon and Corporal Nobbs, said Colon. Yeah, you remember us, don't you? said Nobby, in a wheedling voice. We was the ones who helped you when you was fighting them three dwarfs last week. You's pulled me off of them, if that's what you mean, said Wee Mad Arthur, just when I got them all down. We want to talk to you about some rats, said Colon. Can't take on any more customers, said Wee Mad Arthur firmly. Some rats you sold to Gimlet's Whole Food Delicatessen a few days ago. What's that to yous? He reckons they was poisoned, said Nobby, who had taken the precaution of moving behind Colon. I never use his poison. Colon realised he was backing away from a man six inches high. Yeah, well, see, the thing is, you being in fights and that, you don't get on with dwarfs, some people might say. The thing is... It could look like you might have a grudge. He took another step back and almost tripped over Nobby. Grudge? Why should I have a grudge, pal? It ain't me that gets the kicking, said wee mad Arthur, advancing. Good point, good point, said Colin. Only it'd help right if you could tell us where you got those rats from. Like the Patrician's Palace, maybe, said Nobby. The Palace? No one catches rats at the Palace, that's not allowed. No, I remember those rats, they was good fat ones. I wanted a penny each, but he held out for four for threepence, the old skinflint that he is. Where'd you get them, then? We mad Arthur shrugged. Down the cattle market. I do the cattle market Tuesdays. Couldn't tell you where they came from. Them tunnels goes everywhere, see? Could they have eaten poison before you caught them? said Colin. We mad Arthur bristled. No one puts down poison round there. I won't have it, see. I've got all the contracts along the shambles, and I won't deal with any gobshite who uses poison. I doesn't charge for extermination, see. Guild hates that, but I chooses me customers. We mad Arthur grinned wickedly. I only goes there when there's the finest eating for the rats and I clean up flogging them to the lawn ornaments. I find anyone using poison on my patch they can pay guild rates for guild work. <laughs> see how they like it. I can see you're going to be a big man in industrial catering, said Colon. We mad Arthur put his head on one side. Just now what happened to the last man that made a crack like that, he said. Er, uh, no, said Colon. Neither does anyone else, said we mad Arthur, because he was never found. Have you finished? Only I got a wasp's nest to clean out before I go home. So you were catching them under the shambles, Colon persisted. All the way along, it's a good beat. There's tanners, tallow men, butchers, sausage makers. That's good grazing if you're a rat. Yeah, right, said Colin. Fair enough. Well, I reckon we've taken up enough of your time. How do you catch wasps, said Nobby, intrigued. Smoke them out? Tis unsporting not to hit them on the wing, said wee mad Arthur. But if it's a busy day, 
I'll make up squibs out of that number one black powder the alchemists sell. He indicated the laden bandoliers over his shoulder. You blow em up, said Nobby. That don't sound too sporting. Yeah, just ever tried setting and lighting up a dozen fuses and then fighting your way back out of the entrance before the first one goes off? It's a wild goose chase, Sarge, said Nobby, as they strolled away. Some rat set poison somewhere and he got them. What are we supposed to do about it? Poisoning rats ain't illegal. Colon scratched his chin. I think we could be in a bit of trouble, Nobby, he said. I mean, everyone's been bustling around detectoring, and we could end up looking at a couple of noddies. I mean, do you want to go back to the yard and say we talked a wee mad after and he said it wasn't him? End of story? We're humans, right? Well, I am. And I know you probably are. And we're definitely bringing up the rear around here. I'm telling you, this ain't my watch anymore, Nobby. Trolls, dwarfs, gargoyles. I've nothing against them, you know me. But I'm looking forward to my little farm of chickens round the door. And I wouldn't mind going out with something to be proud of. Well, what do you want us to do? Knock on every door round the cattle market and ask them if they've got any arsenic in the place? Yep, said Colin. Walk and talk, that's what Vimes always says. There's hundreds of them. Anyway, they'd say no. Right, but we gotta ask. Taint like it used to be, Nobby, this modern policing, detectoring. These days we gotta get results. I mean, the watch is getting bigger. I don't mind old Detritus being a sergeant. He's not bad when you get to know him. But one of these days it could be a dwarf giving out orders, Nobby. It's all right for me, because I'll be out on my farm. Nailing chickens round the door, said Nobby. But you got your future to think of. And the way things are going, maybe the watch will be looking for another captain. It'd be a right bugger if he turned out to have a name like Strong in the Army, or Shale, so you'd better look smart. You never wanted to be Captain Fred? Me, a officer, I have my pride, Nobby. I've nothing against officering for them as is called to it, but it's not for the likes of me. My place is with the common man. I wish mine was, said Nobby gloomily. Look what was in my pigeonhole this morning. He handed the sergeant a square of card with gold edging. Lady Silarchi will be at home this p.m. from five onwards and requests the pleasure of the company of Lord de Nobby's, he read. Oh. I've heard about these rich old women, said Nobby dejectedly. I reckon she wants me to be a giggle low. Is that right? Na nah, na, nah, said the sergeant, looking at Passion's most unlikely plaything. I know this stuff from my uncle. At home is like a bit of a drink stew. It's where all you knobs hobnob nobby. You just drink and scoff and talk about literature and the art. Oh, I haven't got any posh clothes, said Nobby. Ah, that's where you score, Nobby, said Colon. Uniforms is okay. Adds a bit of tone, in fact. Especially if you look dashing, he said, ignoring the evidence that Nobby was, in fact, merely runny. Is that a fact, said Nobby, brightening up a bit. I've got a lot more of them invites, too, he said. Posh cars, what look like they've been nibbled along the edges with gold teeth. Dinners, balls, all kinds of stuff. Colon looked down at his friend. A strange and yet persuasive thought crept into his mind. Well, he said, it's the end of the social season, see? Time's running out. What for? Well, could be all them posh women want to marry you after their daughters who are in season. What? Nothing beats an earl except a duke, and we haven't got one of them, and we ain't got a king neither. The Earl of Ankh would be what they call a social catch. Yes, it was easier if he said it to himself like that. If you substituted Nobby Nobs for Earl of Ankh, it didn't work. But it did work when you just said Earl of Ankh. There'd be many women who'd be happy to be the mother-in-law of the Earl of Ankh, even if it meant having Nobby Nobs into the bargain. Well... A few, anyway. Nobby's eyes gleamed. Never thought of that, he said. And some of these girls have a bit of cash, too. More than you, Nobby. And of course I owes it to my posterity to see that the line of nubses doesn't die out, Nobby added thoughtfully. Colon beamed at him with the rather worried expression of a mad doctor who has bolted on the head, applied the crackling lightning to the electrodes, and is now watching his creation lurch down to the village. Cool, said Nobby, his eyes now unfocusing slightly. Right, but before that, said Colon, I'll do all the places along the shambles, and you do Chitling Street, and then we can push off back to the yard, job done and dusted, okay? 
Afternoon, Commander Vimes, said Carrot, shutting the door behind him. Captain Carrot reporting. Vimes was slumped in his chair, staring at the window. The fog was creeping up again. Already the opera house opposite was a little hazy. We, uh, had a look at as many golems as we could, sir, said Carrot, trying diplomatically to see if there was a bottle anywhere on the desk. There's hardly any, sir. We found eleven had smashed themselves up or sawn their heads off, and by lunchtime people were smashing them or taking out their words themselves, sir. It's not nice, sir. There's bits of pottery all over the city. It's as if people were just waiting for the opportunity. It's odd, sir. All they do is work and keep themselves to themselves and don't offer any harm to anyone. And some of the ones that smashed themselves left, well, notes, sir sort of saying they were sorry and ashamed, sir. They kept on going on about their clay. Vimes did not respond. Carrot leaned sideways and down in case there was a bottle on the floor. And Gimlet's whole food delicatessen has been selling poisoned rat. Ask Nick, sir. I've asked Sergeant Colon and Nobby to follow that one. It might just be some kind of a mix-up, but you never know. Vimes turned. Carrot could hear his breathing, short, sharp bursts, like a man trying to keep himself under control. "'What have we missed, Captain?' he said in a faraway voice. "'Sir?' "'In his lordship's bedroom. There's the bed, the desk, things on the desk, the table by the bed, the chair, the rug, everything. We've replaced everything. He eats food. We've checked the food, yes?' "'The whole larder, sir. Is that a fact?' We might be wrong there. I don't understand how, but we might be wrong. There's some evidence lying in the cemetery that suggests we are. Vimes was nearly growling. What else is there? Little Bottom says there's no marks on him. What else is there? Let's find out the how, and with any luck, that'll give us the who. He breathes the air more than anyone else, sir. But we moved him into another bedroom. Even if someone was, I don't know, pumping poison in, they couldn't change rooms with us all watching. It's got to be the food. I've watched them taste it, sir. Then it's something we're not seeing, damn it. People are dead, Captain. Mrs. Easy's dead. Who, sir? You've never heard of her? Can't say that I have, sir. What did she used to do? Do? Nothing, I suppose. She just brought up nine kids in a couple of rooms you couldn't stretch out in, and she sewed shirts for tuppence an hour, every hour the bloody gods sent. And all she did was work, and keep herself to herself. And she is dead, Captain. And so's her grandson, aged fourteen months, because her granddaughter took them some grub from the palace. A bit of a treat for them. And you know what? Mildred thought I was going to arrest her for theft. At the damn funeral, for God's sake! Vimes' fists opened and closed, his knuckles showing white. It's murder now. Not assassination, not politics. It's murder, because we're not asking the right damn questions. The door opened. Oh, good afternoon, Squire, said Sergeant Colon brightly, touching his helmet. Sorry to bother you. I expect it's your busy time, but I've got to ask just to eliminate you from our inquiries, so to speak. Do you use any arsenic around the place? Uh, don't leave the officer standing there, Fanley, said a nervous voice, and the workman stepped aside. Good afternoon, officer. How may we help you? Checking up on arsenic, sir? Seems some's been getting where it shouldn't. Uh, really? Good heavens. I'm sure we don't use any, but uh, do come inside while I check with the foreman. I'm certain there's a pot of tea, hot, too. Polon looked behind him. The mist was rising, the sky was going grey. Wouldn't say no, sir, he said. The door closed behind him. A moment later there was the faint scrape of the bolts. Right, said Vimes. Let's start again. He picked up an imaginary ladle. I'm the cook. I've made this nourishing gruel that tastes like dog's water. I'm filling up three bowls. Everyone's watching me. All the bowls have been well washed, right? OK. The tasters take two, one to taste and these days the others for Little Bottom to check, and then a servant, that's you, Carrot, takes the third one and puts it in the dumb waiter, sir. There's one up to every room. I thought they carried them up. Six floors, it'd get stone cold, sir. All right, hold on, we've gone too far. You've got the bowl. Do you put it on a tray? Yes, sir. Put it on a tray, then. Carrot obediently put the invisible bowl on an invisible tray. 
Anything else? said Vimes. Piece of bread, sir, and we check the loaf. Soup spoon? Yes, sir. Well, don't just stand there. Put them on. Carrot detached one hand from the invisible tray to take an invisible piece of bread and an intangible spoon. Anything else? said Vimes. Salt and pepper? I think I remember salt and pepper pots, sir. On they go, then. Vimes stared, hawk-like, at the space between Carrot's hands. No, he said. We wouldn't have missed that, would we? I mean, we wouldn't, would we? He reached out and picked up an invisible tube. Tell me we've checked the salt, he said. That's the pepper, sir, said Carrot, helpfully. Salt, mustard, vinegar, pepper, said Vimes. We didn't check all the food and then let his lordship tip poison on to suit his taste, did we? Ask Nick's a metal. Can't you get metal salts? Tell me we asked ourselves that. We aren't that stupid, are we? I'll check directly, said Carrot. He looked around desperately. I'll just put the tray down. Not yet, said Vimes. I've been here before. We don't rush off shouting, give me a towel, just because we've had one idea. Let's keep looking, shall we? The spoon, what's it made of? Good point. I'll check the cutlery, sir. Now we're cooking with charcoal. What's he been drinking? Boiled water, sir. We've tested the water and I'll check the glasses. Good. So, we've got the tray and you put the tray in the dumb waiter and then what? The men in the kitchen haul on the ropes and it goes up to the sixth floor. No stops? Carrot looked blank. It goes up six floors, said Vimes. It's just a shaft with a big box in it that can be pulled up and down, isn't it? I'll bet there's a door into it on every floor. Some of the floors are hardly used these days, sir. Even better for our poisoner, hmm? He just stands there bold as you like and waits for the tray to come by, right? We don't know that the meal which arrives is the one that left, do we? Brilliant, sir. It happens at night, I'll swear, said Vimes. He's chipper in the evenings and out like a light next morning. What time is his supper sent up? While he's poorly, around six o'clock, sir, said Carrot. It's got dark by then, then he gets on with his writing. Right. We've got a lot to do. Come on. The patrician was sitting up in bed reading when Vimes entered. Ah, Vimes, he said. Your supper will be up shortly, my lord, said Vimes. And can I once again say that our job would be a lot easier if you let us move you out of the palace? I'm sure it would be, said Lord Betinari. There was a rattle from the dumb waiter. Vimes walked across and opened the doors. There was a dwarf in the box. He had a knife between his teeth and an axe in each hand and was glowering with ferocious concentration. Good heavens, said Betinari weakly. I hope at least they've included some mustard. Any problems, constable? said Vimes. No, sir, said the dwarf, unfolding himself and removing the knife. Very dull all the way up, sir. There was other doors, and they all looked pretty unused, but I nailed them up anyway, like Captain Carrot said, sir. Well done. Down you go. Vimes shut the doors. There was more rattling as the dwarf began its descent. Every detail covered, eh, huh? Vimes? I hope so, sir. The box came up again with a tray in it. Vimes took it out. What's this? A clatching hots without anchovies, said Vimes, lifting the cover. We got it from Ron's Pizza Hobble round the corner. The way I see it, no one can poison all the food in the city, and the cutlery's from my place. You have the mind of a true policeman, Vimes. Thank you, sir. Really? Was it a compliment? The patrician prodded at the plate with the air of an explorer in a strange country. Has someone already eaten this, Vimes? No, sir, that's just how they chop up the food. Oh, I see. I thought perhaps the food tasters were getting over-enthusiastic, said the patrician. My word, what a treat I have to look forward to. I can see you're feeling a lot better, sir, said Vimes stiffly. Thank you, Vimes. When Vimes had gone, Lord Vetinari ate the pizza, or at least those parts of it he thought he could recognize. Then he put the tray aside and blew out the candle by his bed. He sat in the dark for a while, then felt under his pillow until his finger located a small sharp knife and a box of matches. Thank goodness for Vimes. There was something endearing about his desperate, burning, and above all, misplaced competence. If the poor man took any longer, he'd have to start giving him hints. In the main office, Carrot sat alone, watching Dorful. 
The golem stood where it had been left. Someone had hung a dishcloth on one arm. The top of its head was still open. Carrot spent a while with his chin on one hand, just staring. Then he opened a desk drawer and took out Dorfel's chem. He examined it. He got up. He walked over to the golem. He placed the words in the head. An orange glow rose in Dorfel's eyes. What was baked pottery took on that faintest of auras that marked the change between the living and the dead. Carrot found the golem's slate and pencil and pushed them into Dorfel's hand, then stood back. The burning gaze followed him as he removed his sword belt, undid his breastplate, took off his jerkin, and pulled his woolen vest over his head. The glow was reflected from his muscles. They glistened in the candlelight. No weapons, said Carrot, no armor. You see? Now, listen to me. Dorfel lurched forward and swung a fist. Carrot did not move. The fist stopped a hair's breadth from Carrot's unblinking eyes. I didn't think you could, he said, as the golem swung again, and the fist jerked to a stop a fraction of an inch from Carrot's stomach. But sooner or later you'll have to talk to me. Right, anyway. Dorfel paused. Then it picked up the slate pencil. Take my words. Tell me about the golem who killed people. The pencil did not move. The others have killed themselves, said Carrot. I know. How do you know? The golem watched him. Then it wrote, Clay of my clay. You feel what other golems feel, said Carrot. Dorful nodded. And people are killing golems, said Carrot. I don't know if I can stop that, but I can try. I think I know what's happening, Dorful, some of it. I think I know who you were following, clay of your clay, shaming you all. Something went wrong. You tried to put it right. I think you all had such hopes. But the words in your head will defeat you every time. The golem stayed motionless. You sold him, didn't you? said Carrot quietly. Why? The words were scribbled quickly. Golem must have a master. Why? Because the words say so? Golem must have a master. Carrot sighed. Men had to breathe, fish had to swim. Golems had to have a master. I don't know if I can sort this out, but no one else is going to try, believe me, he said. Dorful did not move. Carrot went back to where he'd been standing. I'm wondering if the old priest and Mr. Hopkinson did something, or helped to do something, he said, watching the golem's face. I'm wondering if afterwards something turned against them, found the world a bit too much. Dorful remained impassive. Carrot nodded. Anyway, you're free to go. What happens now is up to you. I'll help you if I can. If a golem is a thing, then it can't commit murder and I'll still try to find out why all this is happening. If a golem can commit murder, then you are people, and what is being done to you is terrible and must be stopped. Either way, you win, Dorful. He turned his back and fiddled with some papers on his desk. The big trouble, he added, is that everyone wants someone else to read their minds for them and then make the world work properly. Even golems, perhaps. He turned back to face the golem. I know you've all got a secret, but the way things are going, there won't be any of you left to keep it. He looked hopefully at Dorful. No, clay of my clay, I will not betray. Carrot sighed. Well, I won't force you, he grinned, although you know I could. I could write a few extra words on your chem, tell you to be talkative. The fires rose in Dorful's eyes. But I won't, because that would be inhumane. You haven't murdered anyone. I can't deprive you of your freedom because you haven't got any. Go on, you can go. It's not as if I don't know where you live. To work is to live. What is it golems want, Dorful? I've seen you golems walking around the streets and working all the time, but what is it you actually hope to achieve? The slate pencil scribbled. Respite. Then Dorful turned around and walked out of the building. Damn, said Carrot, a difficult linguistic feat. He drummed his fingers on the desk, then got up abruptly, put his clothing back on, and stalked down the corridor to find Angua. She was leaning against the wall in Corporal Littlebottom's office, talking to the dwarf. 
I've sent Dorful home, said Carrot. Has he got one? said Angua. Well, back to the slaughterhouse anyway, but it's probably not a good time for a golem to be out alone, so I'm just going to stroll along after him and keep... Are you all right, Corporal Littlebottom? Yes, sir, said Cherry. You're wearing, er... Uh, um... Carrot's mind rebelled at the thought of what the dwarf was wearing and settled for... Er... Uh, kilt? Yes, sir. A skirt, sir. A leather one, sir. Carrot tried to find a suitable response and had to resort to... Oh. I'll come with you, said Angua. Cherry can keep an eye on the desk. A kilt, said Carrot. Oh, well, uh, just keep an eye on things. We won't be long, and uh, just keep behind the desk, all right. Come on, said Angua. When they were out in the fog, Carrot said, Do you think there's something a bit odd about Little Bottom? Seems like a perfectly ordinary female to me, said Angua. Female? He told you he was female? She, Angua corrected. This is Ankh Morpork, you know. We've got extra pronouns here. She could smell his bewilderment. Of course, everyone knew that somewhere down under all those layers of leather and chainmail, dwarfs came in enough different types to ensure the future production of more dwarfs. But it was not a subject that dwarfs discussed, other than at those essential points in a courtship when embarrassment might otherwise arise. Well, I would have thought she'd have the decency to keep it to herself, Carrot said finally. I mean, I've nothing against females. I'm pretty certain my stepmother is one. But I don't think it's very clever, you know, to go around drawing attention to the fact. Carrot, I think you've got something wrong with your head, said Angua. What? I think you may have got it stuck up your bum. I mean, good grief, a bit of make-up and a dress, and you're acting as though she'd become Miss Vavavoom and started dancing on tables down at the skunk club. There were a few seconds of shocked silence while they both considered the image of a dwarfish striptease dancer. Both minds rebelled. Anyway, said Angua, if people can't be themselves in Aunt Morpork, where can they? There'll be trouble when the other dwarfs notice, said Carrot. I could almost see his knees, her knees. Everyone's got knees. Perhaps, but it's asking for trouble to flaunt them. I mean, I'm used to knees. I can look at knees and think, oh yes, knees, they're just hinges in your legs. But some of the lads... <laughs> Angua sniffed. He turned left here. Some of the lads what? Well, I don't know how they'll react, that's all. You shouldn't have encouraged her. I mean, of course there's female dwarfs, but, I mean, they have the decency not to show it. He heard Angua gasp. Her voice sounded rather far away when she said, Carrot, you know, I've always respected your attitude to the citizens of Aunt Morpork. Yes? I've been impressed by the way you really seem to be blind to things like shape and colour. Yes? And you always seem to care for people. Yes? And you know that I feel considerable affection for you. Yes? It's just that sometimes... Yes? I really, really, really wonder why. Carriages were thickly parked outside Lady Selarchi's mansion when Corporal Nobbs strolled up the drive. He knocked on the door. A footman opened it. Servants' entrance, said the footman, and made to shut the door again. But Nobby's outstretched foot had been ready for this. Raid days, he said, thrusting two bits of paper at him. The first one read, I, after hearing evidence from a number of experts, including Mrs. Slipdry, the midwife, certify that the balance of probability is that the bearer of this document, C.W. St. John Nobbs, is a human being. Signed, Lord Vetinari. The other was the letter from Dragon, King of Arms. The footman's eyes widened. Oh, I am terribly sorry, your lordship, he said. He stared again at Corporal Nobbs. Nobby was clean-shaven. At least the last time he'd shaved he'd been clean-shaven, but his face had so many minor topological features that it looked like a very bad example of slash-and-burn agriculture. Who, oh, dear, added the footman. He pulled himself together. The other visitors normally just have cards. Nobby produced a battered deck. I'm probably busy hobnobbing right now, he said, but I'm game for a few rounds of crippled Mr. Runyon afterwards, if you like. The footman looked him up and down. He didn't get out much. He'd heard rumours, who hadn't, that working in the watch was the rightful king of Ankh-Morpork. 
He'd have to admit that if you wanted to hide a secret heir to the throne, you couldn't possibly hide him more carefully than under the face of C.W. St. J. Nobbs. On the other hand, the footman was something of an historian, and knew that in its long history even the throne itself had been occupied by creatures who had been hunchbacked, one-eyed, knuckle-dragging, and as ugly as sin. On that basis, Nobby was as royal as they came. If, technically, he wasn't hunchbacked, this was only because he was hunched front and sides, too. There might be a time, the footman thought, when it paid to hitch your wagon to a star, even if said star was a red dwarf. You've never been to one of these affairs before, my lord, he said. First time, said Nobby. I'm sure your lordship's blood will rise to the occasion, said the footman, weakly. I'll have to go. Angua thought as they hurried through the fog. I can't go on living from month to month. It's not that he's not likable. You couldn't wish to meet a more caring man. That's just it. He cares for everyone. He cares about everything. He cares indiscriminately. He knows everything about everyone because everyone interests him. And the caring is all general and never personal. He doesn't think personal is the same as important. If only he had some decent human quality like selfishness. I'm sure he doesn't think about it that way, but you can tell the werewolf thing is upsetting him underneath. He cares about the things people say behind my back, and he doesn't know how to deal with them. What was it those dwarfs said the other day? One said something like, She feels the need, and the other one said, Yeah, the need to feed. Well, I saw his expression. I can handle that sort of thing, well, most of the time, but he can't. If only he'd thump someone. It wouldn't do any good, but at least he'd feel better. It's going to get worse. At best, I'm going to get caught in someone's chicken house, and then the midden is really going to hit the windmill. Or I'll get caught in someone's room. She tried to shut out the thought, but it didn't work. You could only control the werewolf. You couldn't tame it. It's the city. Too many people, too many smells. Maybe it would work if we were just alone somewhere. But if I said, it's me or the city, he wouldn't even see there was a choice. Sooner or later, I've got to go home. It's the best thing for him. Vimes walked back through the damp night. He knew he was too angry to think properly. He'd got nowhere, and he'd travelled a long way to get there. He'd got a cartload of facts, and he'd done all the right logical things, and to someone somewhere he must look like a fool. He probably looked like a fool to Carrot already. He'd kept coming up with bright ideas, proper policeman's ideas, and each one had turned out to be a joke. He'd bullied and shouted and done all the proper things, and none of it had worked. They hadn't found a thing. They'd merely increased their amount of ignorance. The ghost of old Mrs. Easy rose up in his inner vision. He couldn't remember much about her. He'd been just another snotty kid in a crowd of snotty kids, and she'd been just another worried face somewhere on top of a pinny. One of Cockbill Street's people. She'd taken in needlework to make ends meet and kept up appearances, and, like everyone else in the street, had crept through life never asking for anything and getting even less. What else could he have done? They'd practically scraped the damn wallpaper off the walls. He stopped. There was the same wallpaper in both rooms, in every room on that floor, that horrible green wallpaper. But no, that couldn't be it. Betinari had slept in that room for years, if he slept at all. You can't sneak in and redecorate without someone noticing. In front of him, the fog rolled aside. He caught a glimpse of a candlelit room in a nearby building before the cloud flowed back. The fog. Yes, dampness. Creeping in, brushing against the wallpaper. The old dusty, musty wallpaper. Would Cheery have tested the wallpaper? After all, in a way, you didn't actually see it. It wasn't in the room because it was defining what the room was. Could you actually be poisoned by the walls? He hardly dared think the thought. If he let his mind settle on the suspicion, it'd twist and fly away like all the others. But this was it, said his secret soul. All the messing around with suspects and clues, that was just something to keep the body amused while the back of the brain toiled away. Every real copper knew you didn't go around looking for clues so that you could find out who'd done it. No, you started out with a pretty good idea of who'd done it. That way, you knew what clues to look for. He wasn't going to have another day of bafflement interspersed with desperately bright ideas, was he? It was bad enough looking at Corporal Littlebottom's expression, which seemed to be getting a little more colourful every time he saw it. He said, Ah, 
Arsenic's a metal, right, so maybe the cutlery has been made of it. He wouldn't forget the look on the dwarf's face, as Cherry tried to explain that, yes, it might be possible to do that, provided you were sure that no one would notice the way it dissolved in the soup almost instantly. This time, he was going to think first. The Hurl of Honk, Corporal the Right Honourable Lord C. W. St. J. Nobbs. The buzz of conversation stopped. Heads turned. Somewhere in the crowd someone started to laugh and was hurriedly shushed into silence by their neighbours. Lady Silachi came forward. She was a tall, angular woman with the sharp features and aquiline nose that were the hallmarks of the family. The impression was that an axe was being thrown at you. Then she curtsied. There were gasps of surprise around her, but she glared at the assembled guests, and there was a smattering of bows and curtsies. Somewhere at the back of the room, someone started to say, But the man's an absolute oik, and was cut off. Has someone dropped something? said Nobby nervously. I'll help you look if you like. The footman appeared at his elbow, bearing a tray. Hey, drink, my lord, he said. Yeah, okay, a pint of winkles, said Nobby. Jaws fell, but Lady Salaches rose to the occasion. Winkles, she said. Hey, type of beer, your ladyship, said the footman. Her ladyship hesitated only a moment. I believe the butler drinks beer, she said. See to it, man, and I'll have a pint of winkles too. What a novel idea. This caused a certain effect among those guests who knew on which side of the biscuit their pâté was spread. Indeed. <laughs> Capital suggestion. A pint of Winkles here, too. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Oh, great. <laughs> Winkles for me. <laughs> Winkles all round. But the man's an absolute tight. Shut up. Vimes crossed the brass bridge with care, counting the hippos. There was a ninth shape, but it was leaning against the parapet and muttering to itself in a familiar, and to Vimes at least, an unmenacing way. Faint air movements wafted towards him a smell that outsmelled even the river. It proclaimed that ahead of Vimes was a dingaling so big he'd been upgraded to a clangalang. lang <laughs> I told him, stand it up and pull the end off, millennium end and shrimp, I told him. Oh, says I, and would they poke? Evening, Ron, said Vimes, without even bothering to look at the figure. Foul old Ron fell into step behind him. Bugger it. <clears throat> they dumb me out of it, so they did. Yes, Ron, said Vimes. And shrink, bugger it, I say. Oh, bread it on the butter side. <laughs> Queen Molly says to watch your back, mister. What was that? Sell to fry it, said foul old Ron innocently. Trails of a lot of them if they did me out of it. Them and their big weasel. The beggar lurched around, and filthy coat dragging its hems along the ground, limped away into the fog. His little dog trotted along in front of him. There was pandemonium in the servants' hall. Winkle's old peculiar, said the butler. Another one hundred and four pints, said the footman. The butler shrugged. Harry, Sid, Rob and Geoffrey, two trays apiece and doubled down to the king's head again right now. What else is he doing? Well, they're supposed to be having a poetry reading, but he's telling them jokes. Anecdotes? Not exactly. It was amazing how it could drizzle and fog at the same time. Wind was blowing both through the open window, and Vimes was forced to shut it. He lit the candles by his desk and opened his notebook. Probably he should use the demonic organiser, but he likes to see things written down fair and square. He could think better when he wrote things down. He wrote, Arsenic, and drew a big circle round it. Around the circle he wrote, Father Tubalchek's fingernails, and rats, and veterinari, and Mrs. Easy. Lower down the page he wrote, Golems, and drew a second circle. Around that one he wrote, Father Tubalchek, and Mr. Hopkinson, after some thought, he wrote down, Stolen Clay, and Grog. And then, why would a golem admit to something it didn't do? He stared at the candlelight for a while, and then wrote, Rats eat stuff. More time passed. What has the priest got that anyone wants? From downstairs came the sound of armour as a patrol came in. A corporal shouted, 
words, wrote Vimes. What had Mr. Hopkinson got? Dwarf bread? Arrow, not stolen. What else had he got? Vimes looked at this too, and then he wrote, Bakery, stared at the word for a while, and rubbed it out, and replaced it with, Oven? He drew a ring around oven, and a ring around stolen clay, and linked the two. There'd been arsenic under the old priest's fingernails. Perhaps he'd put down rat poison. There were plenty of uses for arsenic. It wasn't as if you couldn't buy it by the pound from any alchemist. He wrote down, Arsenic Monster, and looked at it. You found dirt under fingernails. If people had put up a fight, you might find blood or skin. You didn't find grease and arsenic. He looked at the page again, and after still more thought, wrote, Golems aren't alive, but they think they are alive. What do things that are alive do? Arrow. Answer. Breathe, eat, crap. He paused, staring out at the fog, and then wrote very carefully, And make more things. Something tingled at the back of his neck. He circled the late Hopkinson's name and drew a line down the page to another circle in which he wrote, He'd got a big oven. Hmm. Cheery had said you couldn't bake clay properly in a bread oven, but maybe you could bake it improperly. He looked up at the candlelight again. They couldn't do that, could they? Oh, gods, no, surely not. But after all, all you needed was clay, and a holy man who knew how to write the words, and someone to actually sculpt the figure, Vimes supposed, but golems had hundreds and hundreds of years to learn to be good with their hands, those great big hands, the ones that looked so very fist-like. And then the first thing they'd want to do would be to destroy the evidence, wouldn't they? They probably didn't think of it as killing, but more like a sort of switching off. He drew another rather misshapen circle on his notes. Grog, old baked clay, ground up small. They'd added some of their own clay. Dorfel had a new foot, didn't he? It? It hadn't made it quite right. They'd put part of their own selves into a new golem. That all sounded, well, Nobby would call it mucky. Vimes didn't know what to call it. It sounded like some sort of secret society thing. Clay of my clay, my own flesh and blood. Damn hulking things, aping their betters. Vimes yawned. Sleep. He'd be better for some sleep. Or something. He stared at the page. Automatically his hand trailed down to the bottom drawer of his desk, as it always did when he was worried and trying to think. It wasn't as though there was ever a bottle there these days, but old habits died hard. There was a soft, glassy ching and a faint, seductive slosh. Vimes's hand came up with a fat bottle. The label said, Beer Huggers Distilleries, the Macabre Finest Malt. The liquid inside almost crawled up the sides of the glass in anticipation. He stared at it. He'd reached down into the drawer for the whiskey bottle, and there it was. But it shouldn't have been. He knew Carrot and Fred Colan kept an eye on him, but he'd never bought a bottle since he'd got married, because he'd promised Sybil, hadn't he? But this wasn't any old rot gut. This was the Macabre. he tried it once. He couldn't quite remember why now, since in those days the only spirits he generally drank had the subtlety of a mallet to the inner ear. He must have found the money somehow. Just a sniff of it had been like Hogswatch night. Just a sniff. And she said, That's funny, it didn't do that last night, said Corporal Nobbs. He beamed at the company. There was silence. Then someone in the crowd started to laugh, one of those little uncertain laughs a man laughs who is unsure that he's not going to be silenced by those around him. Another man laughed. Two more picked it up. Then laughter exploded in the group as a whole. Nobby basked. Then there's the one about the Clatchian who walked into a pub with a tiny piano, he began. I think, said Lady Salachi firmly, that the buffet is a ready. Got any pig knuckles? said Nobby cheerfully. Goes down a trick with winkles, a plate of pig knuckles. He didn't normally eat extremities, said Lady Salachi. A pig knuckle sandwich? Never tried a pig knuckle? You just can't beat it, said Nobby. It is perhaps not the most uh, delicate food, said Lady Salachi. Oh, you can cut the crusts off, said Nobby. Even the toenails, if you're feeling posh. Sergeant Colan opened his eyes and groaned. His head ached. They'd hit him with something. It might have been a wall. They'd tied him up, too. He was trussed hand and foot. 
He appeared to be lying in darkness on a wooden floor. There was a greasy smell in the air which seemed familiar yet annoyingly unrecognisable. As his eyes grew accustomed to the dark, he could make out very faint lines of light such as might surround a door. He could also hear voices. He tried to get up to his knees and groaned as more pain crackled in his head. When people tied you up, it was bad news. Of course, it was much better news than when they killed you, but it could mean they were just putting you on one side for killing later. This never used to happen, he told himself. In the old days, if you caught someone thieving, you practically held the door open for him to escape. That way, you got home in one piece. By using the angle between a wall and a heavy crate, he managed to get upright. This was not much of an improvement on his former position, but after the thunder in his head had died away, he hopped awkwardly towards the door. There were still voices on the other side of it. Someone apart from Sergeant Colon was in trouble. Clown! You got me here for this? There's a werewolf in the watch. <laughs> Not one of your freaks. She's a proper bimorphic. If you tossed a coin, she could smell what side it came down. <laughs> How about if we, if we kill him and drag his body away? You think she couldn't smell the difference between a corpse and a living body? Sergeant Colon moaned softly. Um, uh, how, how about we could march him out in the fog? And they can smell fear, idiot. <laughs> Why couldn't you have let him look around? What could he have seen? I know that copper, a fat old coward with all the brains of a <laughs> pig. He stinks of fear all the time. Sergeant Colon hoped he wasn't about to stink of anything else. Send me sugar after him. <laughs> Are you sure? It's getting odd. It wanders off and screams in the night. <laughs> and they're not supposed to do that. And, 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 and it's cracking up. Trust dumb golems not to do something properly. Everyone knows you can't trust golems. <laughs> See to it. I heard that Vimes is... I've seen to Vimes... Colon eased himself away from the door as quietly as possible. He hadn't the faintest idea what this thing called Meshuggah the golems had made was, except that it sounded like a fine idea to be wherever it wasn't. Now, if he were a resourceful type like Sam Vimes or Captain Carrot, he'd find a nail or something to snap these ropes, wouldn't he? They were really tight and cut into his wrists because the cord was so thin, little more than string wound and knotted many times. If he could find something to rub it on. But, unfortunately, and against all common sense, sometimes people inconsiderately throw their bound enemies into rooms entirely bereft of nails, handy bits of sharp stone, sharp-edged shards of glass, or even, in extreme cases, enough pieces of old junk and tools to make a fully functional armoured car. He managed to get onto his knees again and shuffled across the planks. Even a splinter would do, a lump of metal, a wide-open doorway marked Freedom. He'd settle for anything. What he got was a tiny circle of light on the floor. A knothole in the wood had long ago fallen out, and light, dim orange light, was shining through. Colon got down and applied his eye to the hole. Unfortunately, this also brought his nose into a similar proximity. The stench was appalling. There was a suggestion of wateriness, or at least of liquidity. He must be over one of the numerous streams that flowed through the city, although they had of course been built over centuries before, and were now used, if their existence was even remembered, for those purposes to which humanity had always put clean fresh water, i.e. making it as turbid and undrinkable as possible. And this one was flowing under the cattle markets. The smell of ammonia bored into Colon's sinuses like a drill. And yet there was light down there. He held his breath and took another look. A couple of feet below him was a very small raft. Half a dozen rats were laid neatly on it, and a minute scrap of candle was burning. A tiny rowing boat entered his vision. A rat was in the bottom of it, and sitting amidships and rowing was... We mad, Arthur? The gnome looked up. Who's that there, then? It's me, your good old mate Fred Colon. Can you give me a hand? What she's doing up there? I'm all tied up, and they're going to kill me. Why does it smell so bad? It's the old cockbill stream, and the cattle pens drain into it. Wee Mad Arthur grinned. You can feel it doing your tubes a pair of good, eh? Just call me the King of the Golden River, eh? 
They're going to kill me, Arthur. Don't piss about. <laughs> Good one. Desperate cells flared in Colan's mind. I've been on the trail of those blokes who poisoning your rats. The Rat Catchers Guild, snarled Arthur, almost dropping an oar. I knew it was them right. This is where I got them rats. There's more of them down here, dead as doornails. Right, and I've got to give the names to Commander Vimes in person with all my arms and legs on. He's very particular about that sort of thing. Did you know he's on a trap door, said Arthur. Wait right there. Arthur rode out of sight. Colin rolled over. After a while there was a scratching noise in the walls, and then someone kicked him in the ear. Ow! Would there be any money in this? said wee mad Arthur, holding up his stub of candle. It was a small one, such as might be put on a child's birthday cake. What about your public duty? Ah, so there's no money in this. Lots, I promise, now untie me. This is a string they've used, said Arthur, somewhere around Colon's hand. Not proper rope at all. Colon felt his hands free, although there was still pressure around his wrists. Where's the trap door? he said. Yet on it. Andy for dumping stuff. Don't look as if it's been used for years from underneath. Hey, I've been finding dead rats everywhere down there now. Fat as your head and twice as dead. I thought the ones I caught for Gimlet were a wee bit sluggish. There was a twang and Colon's legs were free. He sat up cautiously and tried to massage some life back into them. Is there any other way out? he said. Plenty for me, but not for a silly bugger like you, said wee mad Arthur. You'll have to swim for it. You want me to drop into that? Don't you worry, you can't drown in it. Are you sure? Yeah, but you may suffocate. You know that creek they talk about, the one you can be up without no paddle? That's not this one, is it? said Colon. It's because of the cattle pens, said wee mad Arthur. Cattle penned up is always a bit nervous. I know how they feel. There was a creak outside the door. Colon managed to get to his feet. The door opened. A figure filled the doorway. It was in silhouette because of the light behind it, but Colon looked up into two triangular glowing eyes. Colon's body, which in many respects was considerably more intelligent than the mind it had to carry around, took over. It made use of the adrenaline-fed start the brain had given it, and leapt several feet in the air, pointing its toes as it came down, so that the iron tips of Colon's boots hit the trapdoor together. The filth of years and the rust of iron gave way. Colon went through. Fortunately, his body had the foresight to hold its own nose as he hit the much maligned stream, which went... <coughs> Many people, when they're precipitated into water, struggle to breathe. Sergeant Colon struggled not to. The alternative was too horrible to think about. He rose again, buoyed up in part by various gases released from the ooze. A few feet away, the candle on wee mad Arthur's rocking raft started to burn with a blue flame. Someone landed on his helmet and kicked it like a man's spurs on a horse. Right, turn, forward! Half walking, half swimming, Colon struggled down the fetid drain. Terror lent him strength. It would demand repayment with interest later, but for now, he left a wake, which took several seconds to close up after him. He didn't stop until a sudden lack of pressure overhead told him that he was in the open air. He grabbed in the darkness, found the greasy pilings of a jetty, and clung to them, wheezing. What was that thing? said wee mad Arthur. <sighs> Golem, Colon panted. He managed to get a hand onto the planks of the jetty, tried to pull himself up, and sagged back into the water. Hey, did I just hear something? said wee mad Arthur. Sergeant Colon rose like an undersea launched missile and landed on the jetty, where he folded up. Nah, just a bird or something, said wee mad Arthur. What do your friends call you, wee mad Arthur? muttered Colon. Tis it now? I ain't got none. Gosh, that's surprising. Lord de Nobbs had a lot of friends now. Up the hatch, here's looking at your bottom, he said. There were shrieks of laughter. Nobby grinned happily in the middle of the crowd. He couldn't remember when he had enjoyed himself so much with all his clothes on. In the far corner of Lady Silarch's drawing room, a door closed discreetly, and in the comfortable smoking room beyond, anonymous people sat down in leather armchairs and looked at one another expectantly. Finally, one said, It's astonishing, frankly astonishing, the man has actually got a charisma. Your meaning? I mean, he's so dreadful, he fascinates people. Like those stories he was telling, did you notice how people kept encouraging him because they couldn't actually believe anyone would tell jokes like that in mixed company? Actually, I rather liked the one about the very small man playing the piano. 
and his table manners. Did you notice them? No, exactly. And the smell, don't forget the smell. Not so much bad as odd. Actually, I found that after a few minutes the nose shuts down, and that my point is that in some strange way he attracts people. Like a public hanging. There was a period of reflective silence. Good-humoured little tit, though, in his way. Not too bright, though. Give him his pint of beer and a plaint of whatever those things with toenails were, and he seems as happy as a pig in muck. I think that's somewhat insulting. I'm sorry. I've known some splendid pigs. Indeed, but I can certainly see him drinking his beer and eating feet while he signs the royal proclamations. Yes, indeed. Ah, uh, do you think he can read? Does it matter? There was some more silence, filled with the busy racing of minds. Then someone said, Another thing, we won't have to worry about establishing a royal succession that might be inconvenient. Why do you think that? Can you see any princess marrying him? Well, they have been known to kiss frogs. Frogs, I grant you. And, of course, power and royalty are powerful aphrodisiacs. How powerful, would you say? More silence, then... Probably not that powerful. He should do nicely. Splendid. Dragon did well. I suppose the little tit isn't really an earl by any chance. Don't be silly. Cherie Littlebottom sat awkwardly on the high stool behind the desk. All she had to do, she'd been told, was check the patrols off and on duty when the shift changed. A few of the men gave her an odd look, but they said nothing, and she was beginning to relax when the four dwarfs on the King's Way beat came in. They stared at her, and her ears. Their eyes travelled downwards. There was no such concept as a modesty panel in Ark Moorpork. All that was usually visible under the desk was the bottom half of Sergeant Colon. Of the large number of good reasons for shielding the bottom half of Sergeant Colon from view, its potential for engendering lust was not among the top ten. That. Female clothes, isn't it? said one of the dwarfs. Cherie swallowed. Why now? She'd sort of assumed Angua would be around. People always calmed down when she smiled at them. It was really amazing. Well, she quavered, S so what? I can if I want to. And on your ear. W well? That my mother never even. Ugh, it's disgusting. And in public too. What happens if kids come in? I can see your ankles, said another dwarf. I'm going to speak to Captain Carrot about this, said the third. I never thought I'd live to see the day. Two of the dwarfs stormed off towards the locker room. Another one hurried after them, but hesitated as he drew level with the desk. He gave Cherie a frantic look. Uh, uh, nice ankles, though, he said, and then ran. The fourth dwarf waited until the others had gone, and then sidled up. Cherie was shaking with nervousness. Don't you say a thing about my legs, she said, waving a finger. Uh, the dwarf looked around hurriedly and leaned forward. Uh, is that lipstick? Yes, what about it? Uh, the dwarf leaned forward even more, looked around again, this time conspiratorially, and lowered her voice. Uh, could I try it? Angua and Carrot walked silently through the fog, except for Angua's occasional crisp and brief directions. Then she stopped. Up until then, Dorfal's scent, or at least the fresh scent of old meat and cow dung, had headed quite directly back to the slaughterhouse district. It's gone up this alley, she said. That's nearly doubling back. And it was moving faster, and there's a lot of humans, and... Sausages? Carrot started to run. A lot of people and the smell of sausages meant a performance of the street theatre that was life in Ankh Morpork. There was a crowd further up the alley. It had obviously been there for some time, because at the rear was a familiar figure with a tray, craning to see over the tops of the heads. What's going on, Mr. Dibbler? Oh, hello, Captain. They've got a golem. Who have? Ah, some blokes. They've just fetched the hammers. There was a press of bodies in front of Carrot. He put both hands together and rammed them between a couple of people and then moved them apart. Grunting and struggling, the crowd opened up like a watercourse in front of the better class of profit. 
Dorful was standing at bay at the end of the alley. Three men with hammers were approaching the golem cautiously, in the way of mobs, each unwilling to strike the first blow in case the second blow came right back at him. The golem was crouching back, shielding itself with its slate, on which was written, I am worth five hundred and thirty dollars. Money, said one of the men, that's all you things think about. The slate shattered under a blow. Then he tried to raise his hammer again. When it didn't budge, he very nearly somersaulted backwards. Money is all you can think about when all you have is a price, said Carrot calmly, twisting the hammer out of his grip. What do you think you're doing, my friend? You can't stop us, mumbled the man. Everyone knows they're not alive. But I can arrest you for willful damage to property, said Carrot. One of these killed that old priest. Sorry, said Carrot. If it's just a thing, how can it commit murder? A sword is a thing, he drew his own sword. It made an almost silken sound. And of course you couldn't possibly blame a sword if someone thrust it at you, sir. The man went cross-eyed as he tried to focus on the sword. And again, Angua felt that touch of bewilderment. Carrot wasn't threatening the man. He wasn't threatening the man. He was merely using the sword to demonstrate a, well, a point. And that was all. He'd be quite amazed to hear that not everyone would think of it like that. Part of her said, Someone has to be very complex indeed to be as simple as Carrot. The man swallowed. Good point, he said. Yeah, but you can't trust them, said one of the other hammer bearers. They sneak around and they never say anything. What are they up to, eh? He gave Dorful a kick. The golem rocked slightly. Well now, said Carrot, that is what I am finding out. In the meantime, I must ask you to go about your business. The third demolition man had only recently arrived in the city and had gone along with the idea because there are some people who do. He raised his hammer defiantly and opened his mouth to say, Oh yeah, but stopped because just by his ear he heard a growl. It was quite low and soft, but it had a complex little waveform which went straight down into a little knobbly bit in his spinal column where it pressed an ancient button marked Primal Terror. He turned. An attractive watchwoman behind him gave a friendly smile. That was to say, her mouth turned up at the corners and all her teeth were visible. He dropped the hammer on his foot. Well done, said Carrot. I've always said you can do more with a kind word and a smile. The crowd looked at him with the kind of expression people always wore when they looked at Carrot. It was the face-cracking realization that he really did believe what he was saying. The sheer enormity tended to leave people breathless. They backed away and scurried out of the alley. Carrot turned back to the golem, which had dropped to its knees and was trying to piece its slate together. Come on, Mr. Dorful, he said. We'll walk with you the rest of the way. Are you mad? said Sock, trying to shut the door. You think I want Zack back? He's your property, said Carrot. People were trying to smash him. You should have let them, said the butcher. Haven't you heard the stories? I'm not having one of those under my roof. He tried to slam the door again, but Carrot's foot was in it. Then I'm afraid you're committing an offence, said Carrot, to wit, littering. Oh, be serious. I always am, said Carrot. He always is, said Angua. Sock waved his hands frantically. It can just go away. Shoop, I don't want a killer working in my slaughterhouse. You have it, if you're so keen. Carrot grabbed the door and forced it wide open. Sock took a step backwards. Are you trying to bribe an officer of the law, Mr. Sock? Are you insane? I am always sane, said Carrot. He always is, sighed Angua. Watchmen are not allowed to accept gifts, said Carrot. He looked around at Dorful, who was standing forlornly in the street. But I will buy him from you for a fair price. Sock looked from Carrot to the golem, and then back again. Buy? For money? Yes. The butcher shrugged. When people were offering you money, it was no time to debate their sanity. Well, that's different, he conceded. It was worth five hundred and thirty when I bought it, but of course it's got additional skills now. Angua growled. It had been a trying evening, and the smell of fresh meat was making her senses twang. You were prepared to give it away a moment ago. Well, give, yes, but business is business. I'll pay you a dollar, said Carrot. A dollar? That's daylight robbery. Angua's hand shot out and grabbed his neck. She could feel the veins, smell his blood, and fear. She tried to think of cabbages. It's night time, she growled. 
like the man in the alley, Sock listened to the call of the wild. A dollar, he croaked. Right, a fair price, one dollar. Carrot produced one, and waved his notebook. A receipt is very important, he said, a proper legal transfer of ownership. Right, 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 um, happy to oblige. Sock glanced desperately at Angua. Somehow her smile didn't look right. He scribbled a few hasty lines. Carrot looked over his shoulder. I, Gerhard Sock, give the bearer full and total ownership of the golem Dorfel in exchange for one dollar, and anything it does now is his responsibility and nothing to do with me. Signed, Gerhard Sock. Interesting wording, but it does look legal, doesn't it? said Carrot, taking the paper. Thank you very much, Mr. Sock. A happy solution all round, I feel. Is that it? Can I go now? Certainly. And the door slammed shut. Oh, well done, said Angua. So now you own a golem. You do know that anything it does is your responsibility. If that's the truth, why are people smashing them? What are you going to use it for? Carrot looked thoughtfully at Dorful, who was staring at the ground. Dorful? The golem looked up. Here's your receipt. You don't have to have a master. The golem took the little scrap of paper between two thick fingers. That means you belong to you, said Carrot encouragingly. You own yourself. Dorful shrugged. What did you expect, said Angua. Did you think it was going to wave a flag? I don't think he understands, said Carrot. It's quite hard to get some ideas into people's heads. He stopped abruptly. Carrot took the paper out of Dorfel's unresisting fingers. I suppose it might work, he said. It seems a bit invasive, but what they understand, after all, is the words. He reached up, opened Dorfel's lid, and dropped the paper inside. The golem blinked. That is to say, its eyes went dark and then brightened again. It raised one hand very slowly and patted the top of its head. Then it held up the other hand and turned it this way and that, as if it had never seen a hand before. It looked down at its feet and around at the fog-shrouded buildings. It looked at Carrot. It looked up at the clouds above the street. It looked at Carrot again. Then, very slowly, without bending in any way, it fell backwards and hit the cobbles with a thud. The light faded in its eyes. There, said Angua, now it's broken. Can we go? There's still a little bit of a glow, said Carrot. It must have all been too much for him. We can't leave him here. Maybe if I took the receipt out. He knelt down by the golem and reached for the trapdoor on its head. Dorfel's hand moved so quickly it didn't even appear to move. It was just there, gripping Carrot's wrist. Ah, said Carrot, gently pulling his arm back. He's obviously feeling better. <laughs> said Dorfel. The voice of the golem shivered in the fog. Golems had a mouth. They were part of the design, but this one was open, revealing a thin line of red light. <gasps> oh, ye gods, said Angua, backing away. They can't speak. <sighs> it was less a syllable than the sound of escaping steam. I'll find your bit of slate, Carrot began, looking around hurriedly. <sighs> Dorful clambered to its feet, gently pushed him out of the way, and strode off. Are you happy now? said Angua. I'm not following that wretched thing. Maybe it's going to throw itself in the river. Parrot ran a few steps after the figure and then stopped and came back. Why do you hate them so much? he said. You wouldn't understand. I really think you wouldn't understand, said Angua. It's an undead thing. They sort of throw in your face the fact that you're not human. But you are human. Three weeks out of four. Can't you understand that? When you have to be careful all the time, it's dreadful to see things like that being accepted. They're not even alive, but they can walk around and they never get people passing remarks about silver or garlic. Up until now, anyway. They're just machines for doing work. That's how they're treated, certainly, said Carrot. You're being reasonable again, snapped Angua. You're deliberately seeing everyone's point of view. Can't you... Try to be unfair, even once. Nobby had been left alone for a moment while the party buzzed around him, so he'd elbowed some waiters away from the buffet and was currently scraping out a bowl with his knife. Ah, Lord de Nobbs, said a voice behind him. He turned. Watcher, he said, licking the knife and wiping it on the tablecloth. 
Are you busy, my lord? Just making myself this meat paste sandwich, said Nobby. That's pâté de foie gras, my lord. Oh, is that what it's called? It doesn't have the kick of clamours beefy might spread, I know that. Want a quail's egg? They're a bit small. No, thank you. There's loads of them, said Nobby generously. They're free. You don't have to pay. Even so, I can get six in me mouth at once. Watch. Amazing, my lord. I was wondering, however, whether you would care to join a few of us in the smoking room? Woof, woof, woof. Indeed. A friendly arm was put around Nobby's shoulders, and he was adroitly piloted away from the buffet, but not before he had grabbed a plate of chicken legs. So many people want to talk to you. Woof. Sergeant Colon tried to clean himself up, but trying to clean yourself up with water from the Ark was a difficult manoeuvre. The best you could hope for was an all-over grey. Fred Colon hadn't reached Vimes' level of sophisticated despair. Vimes took the view that life was so full of things happening erratically in all directions that the chances of any of them making some kind of relevant sense were remote in the extreme. Colon, being by nature more optimistic and by intellect a good deal slower, was still at the clues-are-important stage. Why had he been tied up with string? There were still loops of it around his arms and legs. You're sure you don't know where I was, he said. Yes, walked into the place, said wee mad Arthur, trotting along beside him. How come you didn't know? Cause it was dark and foggy and I wasn't paying attention, that's why. I was just going through the motions. Hehehe, <laughs> good one. Don't mess about, where was I? Don't ask me, said wee mad Arthur. I just hunts under the whole cattle market area. I don't bother about what's up top. Like I said, them runs go everywhere. Anyone along there makes string? It's all animal stuff, I tell yous. Sausages and soap and stuff like that. Is this the bit where yous gives me the money? Colon patted his pockets. They squelched. You'll have to come to the watch house, wee mad Arthur. I got a business to run here. I'm swearing you in as a special watchman for the night, said Colon. What's the play? Dollar the night. Wee Mad Arthur's tiny eyes gleamed. They gleamed red. Ye gods, you look awful, said Colon. What are you looking at my ear for? Wee Mad Arthur said nothing. Colon turned. A golem was standing behind him. It was taller than any he'd seen before and much better proportioned. A human statue rather than the gross shape of the usual golems, and handsome too in the cold way of a statue, and its eyes shone like red searchlights. It raised a fist above its head and opened its mouth. More red light streamed out. It screamed like a bull. Wee Mad Arthur kicked Colon on the ankle. Are we running or what? he said. Colon backed away, still staring at the thing. It's... it's all right, they can't move fast, he muttered and then his sensible body gave up on his stupid brain and fired up his legs, spinning him around and shoving him in the opposite direction. He risked looking over his shoulder. The golem was running after him in long, easy strides. We mad Arthur caught him up. Colon was used to proceeding gently. He wasn't built for high speeds and said so. And you certainly can't run faster than that thing, he wheezed. Just so long as I can run faster than you, said we mad Arthur. This way... There was a flight of old wooden stairs against the side of a warehouse. The gnome went up them like the rats he hunted. Colon, panting like a steam engine, followed him. He stopped halfway up and looked around. The golem had reached the bottom step. It tested it carefully. The wood creaked and the whole stairway, grey with age, trembled. It won't take the weight, said wee mad Arthur. The bugger's going to smash it up, yeah. The golem took another step. The wood groaned. Colon got a grip on himself and hurried on up the stairs. Behind him, the golem seemed to have satisfied itself that the wood could indeed take its weight, and started to leap from step to step. The rails shook under Colon's hands, and the whole structure swayed. "'Come on, will ye?' said Wee Mad Arthur, who had already reached the top. "'It's gaining on you!' The golem lunged. The stairs gave way. Colon flung out his hands and grabbed the edge of the roof. Then his body thudded into the side of the building. There was the distant sound of woodwork hitting cobbles. Come on, then, said wee mad Arthur. Pull yourself up, you silly bugger. <sighs> Can't, said Conan. Why not? It's holding on to my foot. <sighs> A cigar, your lordship. Brandy, my lord. Lord Dunobs sat back in the comfort of his chair. His feet only just reached the ground. 
Brandy and cigars, eh? This was the life all right. He took a deep puff at the cigar. We were just talking, my lord, about the future governance of the city, now that poor Lord Vetinari's health is so bad. Nobby nodded. This was the kind of thing you talked about when you were a knob. This was what he'd been born for. The brandy was giving him a pleasant warm feeling. It would obviously upset the current equilibrium if we looked for a new patrician at this point, said another armchair. What is your view, Lord de Nobbs? Oh, yeah, right. Uh, the guilds would fight like cats in a sack, said Nobby. Everyone knows that. A masterly summary, if I may say so. There was a general murmur of agreement from the other chairs. Nobby grinned. Ah, oh, yes, this was the bee's pyjamas and no mistake, hobnobbing with his fellow knobs, talking big talk about important matters, instead of having to think up reasons why the tea money tin was empty. Ah, oh, yes. A chair said, Besides, are any of the guild leaders up to the task? Oh, they can organize a bunch of tradesmen, but ruling an entire city, I think not. Gentlemen, perhaps it is time for a new direction. Perhaps it is time for blood to reveal itself. Odd way of putting it, Nobby thought, but clearly this is how you were supposed to speak. At a time like this, said a chair, the city will surely look at those representatives of its most venerable families. It would be in all our interests if such a one would take up the burden. He'd need his head examined if you want my opinion, said Nobby. He took another swig of the brandy and waved the cigar expansively. Still, not to worry, he said. Everyone knows we've got a king hanging around. No problem there. Send for Captain Carrot. That's my advice. Another evening folded over the city in layers of fog. When Carrot arrived back at the watch house, Corporal Littlebottom made a face at him and indicated with the flicker of her eyes the three people sitting grimly on the bench against one wall. They want to see an officer, she hissed, but Sergeant Colin isn't back and I knocked on Mr. Vimes's door and I don't think he's in. Carrot composed his features into a welcoming smile. Mrs. Palm, he said, and Mr. Boggis and Dr. Downey, I am so sorry. We're rather stretched at present, what with the poisoning and this business with the golems. The head of the Assassin's Guild smiled, but only with his mouth. It's about the poisoning we wish to speak, he said. Is there somewhere a little less public? Well, there's the canteen, said Carrot. It'll be empty at this time of night if you just step this way. You do well for yourselves here, I must say said Mrs. Palm. A canteen. She stopped as she stepped through the door. People eat in here, she said. Well, grumble about the coffee mostly, said Carrot, and write their reports. Commander Vimes is keen on reports. Captain Carrot, said Dr. Downey firmly, we have to talk to you on a grave matter concerning... What have I sat in? Carrot brushed a chair hurriedly. Sorry, sir, we don't seem to have much time to clean up. Leave it for now, leave it for now. The head of the Assassin's Guild leaned forward with his hands pressed together. Captain Carrot, we are here to discuss this terrible matter of the poisoning of Lord Vetinari. You really ought to talk to Commander Vimes. I believe that on a number of occasions Commander Vimes has made derogatory comments to you about Lord Vetinari, said Dr. Downey. You mean like he ought to be hung except they can't find a twisty enough rope, said Carrot. Oh, yes, but everyone does that. Do you? Well, no, Carrot admitted, and I believe he personally took over the investigation of the poisoning. Well, yes, but didn't you think that was odd? No, sir, not when I thought about it. I think he's got a sort of soft spot for the patrician in his way. He once said that if anyone was going to kill Vetinari, he'd like it to be him. Indeed. But he was smiling when he said it. Sort of smiling, anyway. He uh, visits his lordship most days, I believe? Yes, sir. And I understand that his efforts to discover the poisoner have not reached any conclusions. Not as such, sir, said Carrot. We've found a lot of ways he's not being poisoned. Downey nodded at the others. We would like to inspect the commander's office, he said. Oh, I don't know if that's... Carrot began. Please think very carefully, 
said Dr. Downey. We three represent most of the guilds in this city. We feel we have a good reason for inspecting the commander's office. You will, of course, accompany us to see that we do nothing illegal. Carrot looked awkward. I suppose if I'm with you, he said. That's right, said Downey. That makes it official. Carrot led the way. I don't even know if he's back, he said, opening the door. As I said, we've been... Oh. Downey peered around him, and at the figure slumped over the desk. It would appear that Sir Samuel is in, he said, but quite out of it. I can smell the drink from here, said Mrs. Palm. It's terrible what drink will do to a man. A whole bottle of Bear Hugger's finest, said Mr. Boggis. All right for some, eh? But he hasn't touched a drop all year, said Carrot, giving the recumbent vimes a shake. He goes to meetings about it and everything. No, let us see, said Downey. He pulled open one of the desk drawers. Captain Carrot, he said, can you witness that there appears to be a bag of greyish powder in here? I will now... Vimes's hand shot out and slammed the drawer on the man's fingers. His elbow rammed back into the assassin's stomach, and as Downey's chin jerked down, Vimes's forearm swung upwards and caught him full on the nose. Then Vimes opened his eyes. What's that? What's that? he said, raising his head. Dr. Dowdy, Mr. Boggis, Carrot, hmm? What? What? screamed Downey. You struck me! Oh, I'm so sorry, said Vimes, concern radiating from every feature as he pushed the chair back into Downey's groin and stood up. I'm afraid I must have dropped off, and of course, when I woke up and found someone stealing from my... You're raving drunk, man, said Mr. Boggis. Vimes's features froze. Indeed. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, he snarled, prodding the man in the chest. A peck of bloody pickled peppers is what Peter Piper damn well picked. Do you want me to continue, he said, poking the man until his back was against the wall. It doesn't get much better. <sighs> what about this packet, shouted Downey, clutching his streaming nose with one hand and waving at the desk with the other. Vimes still wore a wild-eyed, mirthless grin. Ah, well, yes, he said. You've got me there. A highly dangerous substance. Ah, you admit it? Yes, indeed. I suppose I have no alternative but to dispose of the evidence. Vimes grabbed the packet, ripped it open, and tipped most of the powder into his mouth. Mmm, mmm, he said, powder spraying everywhere as he masticated. Feel that tingle on the tongue. But that's arsenic, said Boggis. Good gods, is it? said Vimes, swallowing. Amazing. I've got this dwarf downstairs, you know, clever little bugger, spends all his time with pipes and chemicals and things to find out what is arsenic and what isn't, and all the time here's you, able to spot it just by looking. I've got to hand it to you. He dropped the torn packet into Boggus's hand, but the thief jerked back and the packet tumbled to the floor, spraying its contents. Excuse me, said Carrot. He knelt down and peered at the powder. It is traditionally the belief of policemen that they can tell what a substance is by sniffing it and then gingerly tasting it. But this practice had ceased in the watch ever since Constable Flint had dipped his finger into a black market consignment of ammonium chloride cut with radium, said, Yes, this is definitely slab, wobble, wobble, sclop, and had to spend three days tied to his bed until the spiders went away. Nevertheless, Carrot said, I'm sure this isn't poisonous. He licked his finger and tried a bit. It's sugar, he said. Downey, his composure severely compromised, waved a finger at Vimes. You admitted it was dangerous, he screamed. Right, take too much of it and see what it does to your teeth, bellowed Vimes. What did you think it was? We had information, Boggis began. Oh, you had information, did you, said Vimes. You hear that, Captain? They had information, so that's all right. We acted in good faith, said Boggis. Let me see, said Vimes. Your information was something along the lines of Vimes is dead drunk in the watch house and he's got a bag of arsenic in his desk. And I'll just bet you wanted to act in good faith, huh? Mrs. Palm cleared her throat. This has gone far enough. You are correct, Sir Samuel, she said. We were all sent a note. She handed a slip of paper to Vimes. It had been written in capitals. And I can see we have been misinformed, she added, glaring at Boggis and Downey. Do allow me to apologize. Come, gentlemen. She swept out of the door. Boggis followed her quickly. Downey dabbed at his nose. What's the guild price on your head, Sir Samuel? he said. 
twenty thousand dollars. Really? I think we shall definitely have to upgrade you. Delighted. I shall have to buy a new bear trap. I'll, um, show you out, said Carrot. When he hurried back, he found Vimes leaning out of the window and feeling the wall below it. Not a brick dislodged, Vimes muttered. Not a tile loose, and the front office has been manned all day. Odd, that. He shrugged and walked back to his desk, where he picked up the note. And I shouldn't think we'll be able to find any clues on this, he said. There's too many greasy finger marks all over it. He put down the paper and glared at Carrot. When we find the man responsible, he said, somewhere at the top of the charge sheet is going to be forcing Commander Vimes to tip a whole bottle of single malt onto the carpet. That's a hanging offence. He shuddered. There were some things a man should not have to do. It's disgusting, said Carrot. Fancy them even thinking that you'd poison the patrician. I'm offended that they think I'd be daft enough to keep the poison in my desk drawer, said Vimes, lighting a cigar. Right, said Carrot. Did they think you were some kind of fool who'd keep evidence like that where anyone could find it? Exactly, said Vimes, leaning back. That's why I've got it in my pocket. He put his feet on the desk and blew out a cloud of smoke. He'd have to get rid of the carpet. He wasn't going to spend the rest of his life working in a room haunted by the smell of departed spirits. Carrot's mouth was still open. Oh, good grief, said Vimes. Look, it's quite simple, man. I was expected to go, at last, alcohol, and chug a lug the lot without thinking. Then some respectable pillars of the community, he removed the cigar from his mouth and spat. We're going to find me, in your presence too, which is a nice touch, with the evidence of my crime neatly hidden, but not so well hidden that they couldn't find it. He shook his head sadly. The trouble is, you know, that once the taste's got you, it never lets go. But you've been very good, sir, said Carrot. I've not seen you touch a drop for... Oh, that, said Vimes. I was talking about policing, not alcohol. There's lots of people will help you with the alcohol business, but there's no one out there arranging little meetings where you can stand up and say, My name is Sam, and I'm a really suspicious bastard. He pulled a paper bag out of his pocket. We'll get Little Bottom to have a look at this, he said. I damn sure wasn't going to try tasting it, so I nipped down to the canteen and filled a bag with sugar out of the bowl. It was but the work of a moment to fish Nobby's butts out of it, I might add. He opened the door, poked his head out into the corridor, and yelled, Little Bottom! To Carrot, he added, You know, I feel quite perked up. The old brain has begun to work at last. You know the golem that did the killing? Yes, sir. Ah, but do you know what was special about it? Can't think, sir, said Carrot, except that it was a new one. The golems made it themselves, I think. But of course they needed a priest for the words, and they had to borrow Mr. Hopkinson's oven. I expect the old men thought it would be interesting. They were historians, after all. It was Vimes's turn to stand there with his mouth open. Finally he got control of himself. Yes, yes, of course, he said, his voice barely shaking. Yes, I mean, well, that's obvious, plain as the nose on your face, but, uh, have you worked out what else is special about it? He added, trying to keep any trace of hope out of his voice. You mean the fact that it's gone mad, sir? Well, I didn't think it was a winner of the Ark Morpork Mr. Sanity Award, said Vimes. I mean, they drove it mad, sir, the other golems. They didn't mean to, but it was built in, sir. They wanted it to do so many things. It was like their child, I think, all their hopes and dreams. And when they found out it had been killing people, well, that's terrible to a golem. They mustn't kill. And it was their own clay doing it. It's not a great idea for people, either. But they'd put all their future in it. You wanted me, Commander, said Cheery. Oh, yes. Is this arsenic? said Vimes, handing her the packet. Cheery sniffed at it. It could be arsonous acid, sir. I'll have to test it, of course. I thought acid sloshed about in jars, said Vimes. Er, uh, what's that on your hands? Nail varnish, sir. Nail varnish? Yes, sir. Er, uh, fine, fine. Funny, I thought it would be green. Wouldn't look good on the fingers, sir. I meant the arsenic, little bottom. Oh, you can get all sorts of colours of arsenic, sir. The sulphides, that's the ore, sir, can be red or brown or yellow or grey, sir. And then you cook them up with nitre, and you get arsonous acid, sir, and a load of nasty smoke. Really bad. Dangerous stuff, said Vimes. Not good at all, sir, but useful, sir, said Cheery. Tanners, dyers, painters. It's not just poisonous that have got a use for arsenic. I'm surprised people aren't dropping dead of it all the time, 
said Vimes. Oh, most of them use golems, sir. The words stayed in the air even after Cheery stopped speaking. Vimes caught Carrot's eye and started to whistle hoarsely under his breath. This is it, he thought. This is where we filled ourselves up with so many questions that they're starting to overflow and become answers. He felt more alive than he had for days. The recent excitement still tingled in his veins, kicking his brain into life. It was a sparkle you got with exhaustion, he knew. You were so bone-weary that a shot of adrenaline hit you like a falling troll. They must have it all now. All the bits, the edges, the corners, the whole picture, all there just waiting to be pieced together. These golems, said Carrot, they'd be covered in arsenic, would they? Could be, sir. I saw one at the Alchemist's Guild building in Quirm, and <laughs> it had even got arsenic plated on its hands, sir, on account of stirring crucibles with its fingers. They don't feel heat, said Vimes. Or pain, said Carrot. That's right, said Cheery. She looked uncertainly from one to the other. You can't poison them, said Vimes. And they'll obey orders, said Carrot, without speaking. Golems do all the really mucky jobs, said Vimes. You could have mentioned this before, Cheery, said Carrot. Well, you know, the golems are just there, sir. No one notices golems. Grease under his fingernails, said Vimes to the room in general. The old man scratched at his murderer. Grease under his fingernails with arsenic in it. He looked down at the notebook still on his desk. It's there, he thought. Something we haven't seen, but we've looked everywhere, so we've seen the answer and haven't seen that it is the answer. And if we don't see it now, at this moment, we'll never see it at all. No offence, sir, but that's probably not a help, said Cheery's voice somewhere in the distance. So many of the trades that use arsenic involve some kind of grease. Something we don't see, thought Vimes, something invisible. Now, it wouldn't have to be invisible, something we don't see because it's always there, something that strikes in the night. And there it was. He blinked. The glittering stars of exhaustion were causing his mind to think oddly. Well, thinking rationally hadn't worked. No one move, he said. He held up a hand for silence. There it is, he said softly. There, on my desk. You see it? What, sir? said Carrot. You mean you haven't worked it out? said Vimes. What, sir? The thing that's poisoning his lordship. There it is, on the desk, see? Your notebook? No. He drinks Bear Hugger's whiskey, said Cheery. I doubt it, said Vimes. The blotter, said Carrot. Poisoned pens, a packet of paint weeds. Where are they? said Vimes, patting his pockets. Just sticking out from under the letters in the in tray, said Carrot. He added reproachfully, You know, sir, the ones you don't answer. Vimes picked up the packet and extracted another cigar. Thanks, he said. Ha! I didn't ask Mildred Easy what else she took. But of course, they're a servant's little bonus too. And old Mrs. Easy was a seamstress, a proper seamstress. And this is autumn. Killed by the knights drawing in, see? Carrot crouched down and looked at the surface of the desk. Can't see it myself, sir, he said. Of course you can't, said Vimes, because there's nothing to see. You can't see it, that's how you can tell it's there. If it wasn't there, you'd soon see it. He gave a huge, manic grin. Only you wouldn't. See? You all right, sir, said Carrot. I know you've been overdoing it a bit these last few days. I've been underdoing it, said Vimes. I've been running around looking for damn clues instead of just thinking for five minutes. What is it I'm always telling you? Uh, uh never trust anybody, sir. No, not that. Uh, uh, everyone's guilty of something, sir. Not that either. Uh, uh, just because someone's a member of an ethnic minority doesn't mean they're not a nasty, small-minded little jerk, sir. N when did I say that? Last week, sir, after we'd had that visit from the Campaign for Equal Heights, sir. Well, not that. I mean, I'm pretty sure I always say something else that's very relevant here. Something pithy about police work. Hmm, can't remember anything right now, sir. Well, I'll damn well make something up and start saying it a lot from now on. Jolly good, sir, Carrot beamed. It's good to see you your old self again, sir. Looking forward to kicking ass to prodding buttock, sir. Uh, what have we found, sir? You'll see... We're going to the palace. Fetch Angua, we might need her, and bring the search warrant. You mean the sledgehammer, sir? Yes, and Sergeant Colon, too. 
He hasn't signed in again yet, sir, said Cheery. He should have gone off duty an hour ago. Probably hanging around somewhere, staying out of trouble, said Vimes. We mad Arthur peered over the edge of the wall. Somewhere below Colon, two red eyes stared up at him. Heavy, is it? Kick it with your other foot. There was a sucking sound. Colon winced. Then there was a plop, a moment of silence, and a loud crash of pottery down in the street. The boot it was holding came off, moaned Colon. How did that happen? It got lubricated. We mad Arthur tugged at a finger. Up you come, then. Can't. Why not? I ain't holding on to you no more. Arms tired. Another ten seconds I'm going to be a chalk outline. Nah, no one's got that much chalk. We mad Arthur knelt down so that his head was level with Colon's eyes. If you're going to die, do you mind signing a chitty to say you promised me a dollar? Down below there was a chink of pottery shards. What was that? said Colon. I thought the damn thing smashed up. We mad Arthur looked down. Do you believe in that reincarnation stuff, Mr. Colon? he said. You wouldn't get me touching that foreign muck, said Colon. Well, it's putting itself together like one of them jigsaw puzzles. Well done, we mad Arthur, said Colon. But I know you're just saying that so as I'll make the effort to hold myself upright. Statues don't go putting themselves back together when they're smashed up. Please yourself. It's done nearly a whole leg already. Colon managed to peer down through the small and smelly space between the wall and his armpit. All he could see were shreds of fog and a faint glow. You sure? he said. You run around rat holes, you learns to see good in the dark, said wee mad Arthur. Otherwise you're dead. Something hissed somewhere below Colon's feet. With his one booted foot and his toes, he scrabbled at the brickwork. It's having a wee bit of trouble, said wee mad Arthur conversationally. Looks like it's put its knees on the wrong way round. Dorful sat hunched in the abandoned cellar where the golems had met. Occasionally the golem raised its head and hissed. Red light spilled from its eyes. If something had streamed back down through the glow, soared through the eye sockets into the red sky beyond, there would be... Dorful huddled under the glow of the universe. Its murmur was a long way off, muted, nothing to do with Dorful. The words stood around the horizon, reaching all the way to the sky. And a voice said quietly, You own yourself. Dorful saw the scene again and again, saw the concerned face, hand reaching up, filling its vision, felt the sudden icy knowledge. Own yourself. It echoed off the words and then rebounded, and then rolled back and forth, increasing in volume until the little world between the words was gripped in the sound. Golem must have a master. The letters towered against the world, but the echoes poured around them, blasting like a sandstorm. Cracks started and then ran zigzagging across the stone, and then the words exploded. Great slabs of them, mountain-sized, crashed in showers of red sand. The universe poured in. Dorful felt the universe pick it up and bowl it over and then lift it off its feet and up. And now the golem was among the universe. It could feel it all around, the power of it, the busyness. The spinning complexity of it, the roar. There were no words between you and it. You belonged to it, it belonged to you. You couldn't turn your back on it because there it was in front of you. Dorful was responsible for every tick and swerve of it. You couldn't say, I had orders. You couldn't say, it's not fair. No one was listening. There were no words. You owned yourself. Dorful orbited a pair of glowing suns and hurtled off again. Not, thou shalt not. Say, I will not. Dorful tumbled through the red sky, then saw a dark hole ahead. The golem felt it dragging at him and streamed down through the glow, and the hole grew larger and sped across the edges of Dorful's vision. The golem opened his eyes. No, master. Dorful unfolded in one movement and stood upright. He reached out one arm and extended a finger. The golem pushed the finger easily into the wall where the argument had taken place and then dragged it carefully through the splintering brickwork. It took him a couple of minutes, but it was something Dorful felt needed to be said. Dorful completed the last letter and poked a row of three dots after it. Then the golem walked away, leaving behind 
no master dot dot dot. A blue overcast from the cigars hid the ceiling of the smoking room. Ah, oh, yes, Captain Carrot said a chair. Yes, indeed, but is he the right man? He's got a birthmark shaped like a crown. I've seen it, said Nobby helpfully. But his background. He was raised by dwarfs, said Nobby. He waved his brandy glass at a waiter. Same again, mister. I shouldn't think dwarfs could raise anyone very high, said another chair. There was a hint of laughter. Rumours and folklore, someone murmured. This is a large and busy and above all complex city. I'm afraid that having a sword and a birthmark are not much in the way of qualifications. We would need a king from a lineage that is used to command. Like yours, my lord. There was a sucking, draining noise as Nobby attacked the fresh glass of brandy. Ah, oh, oh, I'm used to command, all right, he said, lowering the glass. People are always ordering me around. We would need a king who had the support of the great families and major guilds of the city. People like Carrot, said Nobby. Oh, the people. Anyway, whoever'd got the job would have his work cut out, said Nobby. Old Vetinari's always pushing paper. What kind of fun is that? It's no life, sitting up all hours, worrying, never a moment to yourself. He held out the empty glass. Same again, me old... Fill it right up this time, eh? No sense in having a great big glass and only sloshing a bit in the bottom, is there? Many people prefer to savour the bouquet, said a quietly horrified chair. They enjoy sniffing it. Nobby looked at his glass with the red-veined eyes of one who'd heard rumours about what the upper crust got up to. Nah, he said. I'll go on sticking it in my mouth if it's all the same to you. If we may get to the point said another chair. A king would not have to spend every moment running the city. He would, of course, have people to do that. Advisors, counsellors, people of experience. So what did he have to do, said Nobby? He'd have to reign, said a chair. Wave. Preside at banquets. Sign things. Got all good brandy, disgustingly. Reign. Sounds like a good job to me, said Nobby. All right for some, eh? Of course, a king would have to be someone who could recognise a hint if it was dropped on his head from a great height, said a speaker sharply, but the other chairs shushed him into silence. Nobby managed to find his mouth after several goes and took another long pull at his cigar. Seems to me, he said, seems to me, what you want to do is find some knob with time on his hands and say, Yo, it's your lucky day. Let's see you wave that hand. Ah, that's a good idea. Does any name cross your mind, my lord? Have a drop more brandy. Why, thanks, you're a toff. Oh, of course, <laughs> so am I, eh? <laughs> that's right, Flunky, all the way to the top. Nah, can't think of anyone that fits the bill. In fact, my lord, we were indeed thinking of uh, <laughs> offering the crown mm, to you. Nobby's eyes bulged, and then his cheek bulged. It's not a good idea to spray finest brandy across the room, especially when your lighted cigar is in the way. The flame hit the far wall, where it left a perfect chrysanthemum of scorched woodwork, while, in accordance with a fundamental rule of physics, Nobby's chair screamed back on its casters and thudded into the door. King! Nobby coughed, and then they had to slap him on the back until he got his breath again. King! he wheezed. And have Mr. Vimes cut me head off? All the brandy you can drink, my lord, said a wheedling voice. It's no good if you ain't got a throat for it to go down. What are you talking about? Mr. Vimes would go spare. He'd go spare. Good heavens, man. My lord, someone corrected. My lord, I mean, when you're king, you can tell that wretched Sir Samuel what to do. You'll be, as you would call it, the boss. You could... Tell old Stoneface what to do, said Nobby. That's right. I'd be a king and tell old Stoneface what to do, said Nobby. Yes, Nobby stared into the smoky gloom. He'd go spare. Listen, you silly little man, my lord, you silly little lord, you'd be able to have him executed if you wished. I couldn't do that. 
Why not? He don't spare. The man calls himself an officer of the law, and whose law does he listen to, eh? Where does his law come from? I don't know, groaned Nobby. He says it comes up through his boots. He looked around. The shadows in the smoke seemed to be closing in. I can't be king. Oh, vines would go spare. Will you stop saying that? Nobby pulled at his collar. Oh, it's a bit hot and smoky in here, he mumbled. Which way's the window? Over there. The chair rocked. Nobby hit the glass, helmet first, landed on top of a waiting carriage, bounced off and ran into the night, trying to escape destiny in general and axes in particular. Cherie Littlebottom strode into the palace kitchens and fired her crossbow into the ceiling. Don't nobody move, she yelled. The patrician's domestic staff looked up from their dinner. When you say, don't know that he'd move, said Drumnot carefully, fastidiously taking a piece of plaster off his plate, do you, in fact, mean... All right, Corporal, I'll take over now, said Vimes, patting Cherie on the shoulder. Is Mildred easy here? All heads turned. Mildred's spoon dropped into her soup. It's all right, said Vimes. I just need to ask you a few more questions. I'm, I'm so sorry, sir. You haven't done anything wrong, said Vimes, walking around the table, but you didn't just take food home for your family, did you? S sir? What else did you take? Mildred looked at the suddenly blank expressions on the faces of the other servants. There was the old sheets, but Mrs. Diblock did say I could have... No, not that, said Vimes. Mildred licked her dry lips. Uh, there was... there was some boot polish. Look, said Vimes, as kindly as possible. Everyone takes small things from the place where they work, small stuff that no one notices. No one thinks of it as stealing. It's like... it's like rights. Odds and ends. Ends, Miss Easy. I'm thinking about the word ends. <gasps> you, you mean candle ends, sir? Vimes took a deep breath. It was such a relief to be right, even though you knew you'd only got there by trying every possible way to be wrong. Ah, he said. But that's not stealing, sir. I've never stolen nothing, sir. But you take home the candle stubs. Still half an hour of light in them, I expect, if you burn them in a saucer, said Vimes gently. But that's not stealing, sir. That's perks, sir. Sam Vimes smacked his forehead. Perks, of course. That was the word I was looking for. Perks. Everyone's got to have perks, aren't I right? Well, that's fine, then, he said. I expect you get the ones from the bedrooms, yes? Even through her nervousness, Mildred Easy was able to grin the grin of someone with an entitlement that lesser beings hadn't got. Yes, sir. I'm allowed, sir. They're much better than the old coarse ones we use in the main hall, sir. And you put in fresh candles when necessary, do you? Yes, sir. Probably slightly more often than necessary, Vimes thought. No point in letting them burn down too much. Perhaps you can show me where they're kept, miss. The maid looked along the table to the housekeeper, who glanced at Commander Vimes and then nodded. She was bright enough to know when something that sounded like a question really wasn't one. We keep them in the candle pantry next door, sir, said Mildred. Lead the way, please. It wasn't a big room, but its shelves were stacked floor to ceiling with candles. There were the yard-high ones used in the public halls, and the small everyday ones used everywhere else, sorted according to quality. These are what we use in his lordship's rooms, sir. Uh, she handed him twelve inches of white candle. Oh, yes. Very good quality. Number fives. Nice white tallow, said Vimes, tossing it up and down. We burn these at home. The stuff we use at the yard is damn near pork dripping. We get ours from carries in the shambles now. Very reasonable prices. We used to deal with Spadger and Williams, but Mr. Carries really cornered the market these days, hasn't he? Yes, sir, and he delivers them special, sir. And you put these candles in his lordship's room every day? Yes, sir. Anywhere else? Oh, no, sir, his lordship's particular about that. We just use number threes. And you take your, uh, perks home? Yes, sir. Gran said they gave a lovely light, sir. I expect she sat up with your little brother, did she? Because I expect he got took sick first. So she sat up with him all night long, night after night, and uh, if I know old Mrs. Easy, she did her sewing. Yes, sir. 
There was a pause. Use my handkerchief, said Vimes after a while. Am I going to lose my position, sir? No, that's definite. No one involved deserves to lose their jobs, said Vimes. He looked at the candle. Except possibly me, he added. He stopped at the doorway and turned. And if you ever want candle ends, we've always got lots at the watch house. Nobby will have to start buying cooking fat like everybody else. What's it doing now? said Sergeant Colon. We mad Arthur peered over the edge of the roof again. It's having problems with its elbows, he said conversationally. It keeps looking at one of them and trying it all the ways up and it's not working. I had that trouble when I put up them kitchen units for Mrs. Colon, said the sergeant. The instructions on how to open a box were inside the box. Uh-oh, it's worked it out, said the rat catcher. Looks like it had it mixed up with its knees after all. Colon heard a clank below him. And now it's gone round the corner. There was a crash of splintering wood. And now it's got into the building. I expect it'll come up the stairs. But it looks like you'll be okay. Why? Because all you've got to do is let go of the roof, see? I'll drop to my death. Right. Nice clean way to go. None of that arms and legs being ripped off stuff first. I want her to buy a farm, moaned Colon. Could be, said Arthur. He looked over the roof again. Or, he said, as if this were hardly a better option, you could try to grab the drain pipe. Colon looked sideways. There was a pipe a few feet away. If he swung his body and really made an effort, he might just miss it by inches and plunge to his death. Does it look safe, he said. Compared with what, mister? Colon tried to swing his legs like a pendulum. Every muscle in his arm screamed at him. He knew he was overweight. He'd always meant to take exercise one day. He just hadn't been aware that it was going to be today. I reckon I can hear it walking up the stairs, said wee mad Arthur. Colon tried to swing faster. What are you going to do, he said. Oh, don't you worry about me, said wee mad Arthur. I'll be fine. I'll jump. Jump? Sure, I'll be safe because I've been normal size. Let's see. You think that you're normal sized? We mad Arthur looked at Colon's hands. Are these your fingers right here by my boots? He said. Right, right. You're normal sized. It's not your fault you've moved into a city full of giants, said Colon. Right. The smaller you are, the lighter you'll fall. Well known fact. A spider will not even notice a drop like this. A mouse would walk away. A horse would break every bone in its body, and a elephant would splat. Oh, gods! muttered Colon. He could feel the drain pipe with his boot now. But getting a grip would mean that there would have to be one long, bottomless moment when he was not exactly holding onto the roof, and not exactly holding onto the drain pipe, and in very serious peril of holding onto the ground. There was another crash from somewhere on the roof. Right, said Wee Mad Arthur. See, is at the bottom. Oh, gods! The gnome stepped off the roof. All okay so far, he shouted as he went past Colon. Oh, gods! Sergeant Colon looked up into the two red glows. Doing fine up to now, said a Dopplering voice from below. Oh, gods! Colon heaved his legs around, stood on fresh air for a moment, grabbed the top of the pipe, ducked his head as a pottery fist swung at him, heard the nasty little noise as the pipe's rusty bolts said goodbye to the wall, and still clinging to a tilting length of cast-iron pipe, as if it were going to help, disappeared backwards into the fog. Mr. Sock looked up at the sound of the door opening, and then cowered back against the sausage machine. You, he whispered, he, you can't come back. I sold you. Dorful regarded him steadily for a few seconds, and then walked past him and took the largest cleaver from the blood-stained rack on the wall. Sock began to shake. I, I was always good to you, he said, always let you have your holy days off. Dorful stared at him again. It's only red light, Sock gibbered to himself, but it seemed more focused. He felt it entering his head through his own eyes and examining his soul. The golem pushed him aside and stepped out of the slaughterhouse and towards the cattle pens. Sock unfroze. They never fought back, did they? They couldn't. It was how the damn things were made. He stared around at the other workers, humans and trolls alike. Don't just stand there! Get it! One or two hesitated. It was a big cleaver in the golem's hand, and when Dorful stopped to look around at them, there was something different about the golem's stance, too. It didn't look like something that wouldn't fight back. But Sock didn't employ people for the muscles in their heads. Besides, no one had really liked a golem around the place. 
A troll aimed a pole-axe at him. Dorfel caught it one-handed without turning his head and snapped the hickory handle with his fingers. A man with a hammer had it plucked from his hand and thrown so hard at the wall that it left a hole. After that they followed at a cautious distance. Dorfel took no further notice of them. The steam over the cattle pens mingled with the fog. Hundreds of dark eyes watched Dorfel curiously as he walked between the fences. They were always quiet when the golem was around. He stopped by one of the largest pens. There were voices from behind. Don't tell me it's going to slaughter the lot of them. We'll never get that lot jointed this shift. I heard where there was one of the carpenters that went out and made five thousand tables in one night. Lost count or something. It was just staring at them. I mean, five thousand tables. One of them had twenty-seven legs. It got stuck on legs. Dorfel brought the cleaver down hard and sliced the lock off the gate. The cattle watched the golem with that guarded expression which cattle have that means they're waiting for the next thought to turn up. He walked onto the sheep pens and opened them too. The pigs were next, and then the poultry. All of them, said Mr. Sock. The golem walked calmly back down the line of pens, ignoring the watchers, and re-entered the slaughterhouse. He came out very shortly afterwards, leading the ancient and hairy billy goat on a piece of string. He went past the waiting animals until he reached the wide gates that led onto the main road, which he opened. Then he let the goat loose. The animal sniffed the air and rolled its slotted eyes. Then, apparently deciding that the distant odor of the cabbage fields beyond the city wall was much preferable to the smells immediately around it, it trotted away up the road. The animals followed it in a rush, but with hardly any other noise than the rustle of movement and the sounds of their hooves. They streamed around the stationary figure of Dorful, who stood and watched them go. A chicken, bewildered by the stampede, landed on the golem's head and started to cluck. Anger finally overcame Sock's terror. What the hell are you doing? he shouted to a field of a few stray sheep as they bolted out of the pens. That's money walking out of the gate, you— Dorful's hand was suddenly around his throat. The golem picked him up and held the struggling man at arm's length, turning his head this way and that as if considering his next course of action. Finally, he tossed away the cleaver, reached up under the chicken that had taken up residence, and produced a small brown egg. With apparent ceremony, the golem smashed it carefully on Sock's scalp and dropped him. The golem's former co-workers jumped back out of the way as Dorfel walked back through the slaughterhouse. There was a tally board on the entrance. Dorfel looked at it for a while, then picked up the chalk and wrote, No master. The chalk crumbled in his fingers. Dorfel walked out into the fog. Cherie looked up from her workbench. The wick's full of arsonous acid, she said. Well done, sir. This candle even weighs slightly more than other candles. What an evil way to kill anyone, said Angua. Certainly very clever, said Vimes. Vetinari sits up half the night writing, and in the morning the candle's burned down. Poisoned by the light. The light's something you don't see. Who looks at the light? Not some plodding old copper. Oh, you're not that old, sir, said Carrot cheerfully. What about plodding? Or oh, that plodding either, Carrot added quickly. I've always pointed out to people that you walk in a very purposeful and meaningful manner. Vimes gave him a sharp look and saw nothing more than a keen and innocently helpful expression. We don't look at the light, because the light is what we look with, said Vimes. OK, and now I think we should go and have a look at the candle factory, shouldn't we? You come, Little Bottom, and bring your... Have you got taller, Little Bottom? High heel boots, sir, said Cherry. I thought dwarfs always wore iron boots. Yes, sir, but I've got high heels on mine, sir. I welded them on. Oh, fine, right. Vimes pulled himself together. Well, if you could still totter, bring your alchemy stuff with you. Detritus should have come off duty from the palace. When it comes to locked doors, you can't beat Detritus. He's a walking crowbar. We'll pick him up on the way. He loaded his crossbow and lit a match. Right, he said. We've done it the modern way. Now let's try policing like Grandfather used to do it. It's time to... Prod buttock, sir, said Carrot hurriedly. Close, said Vimes, taking a deep drag and blowing out a smoke ring. But no cigar. Sergeant Colon's view of the world was certainly changing. Just when something was about to fix itself firmly in his mind as the worst moment of his entire life, it was hurriedly replaced by something even nastier. Firstly, the drain pipe he was riding hit the wall of the building opposite. In a well-organized world, he might have landed on a fire escape, but fire escapes were unknown in Arkmorpork, and the flames generally had to leave via the roof. 
With the pipe thus leaning against the wall, he found himself sliding down the diagonal. Even this might have been a happy outcome were it not for the fact that Colon was a heavy man, and as his weight slid nearer to the middle of the unsupported pipe, the pipe sagged, and cast iron has only a very limited amount of sag before it snaps, which it now did. Colon dropped, and landed on something soft, at least softer than the street, and the something went... He bounced off it, and landed on something lower and softer, which went... and rolled from this onto something even lower and apparently made of feathers, which went insane and pecked him. The street was full of animals, milling around uncertainly. When animals are in a state of uncertainty, they get nervous, and the street was already, as it were, paved with anxiety. The only benefit to Sergeant Colon was that this made it slightly softer than would otherwise have been the case. Hooves trod on his hands. Very large, dribbly noses sneezed at him. Sergeant Colon had not hitherto had a great deal of experience of animals, except in portion sizes. When he'd been little, he'd had a pink stuffed pig called Mr. Dreadful, and he'd got up to Chapter 6 in Animal Husbandry. It had woodcuts in it. There was no mention of hot, smelly breath and great clomping feet like soup plates on a stick. Cows in Sergeant Colon's book should go, Moo. Every child knew that. They shouldn't go, Moo, like some kind of undersea monster, and spray you with spit. He tried to get up, skidded on some cow's moment of crisis, and sat down on a sheep. It went, Bleh! What kind of noise was that for a sheep to make? He got up again and tried to make his way back to the curb. Shoo! Get out of the damn way, you sheep! Gone! A goose hissed at him and stuck out altogether too much neck. Colon backed off and stopped when something nudged him in the back. It was a pig. It was no Mr. Dreadful. This wasn't the little piggy that went to market, or the little piggy that stayed at home. It would be quite hard to imagine what kind of foot would have a piggy like this, but it would probably be the kind that also had hair and scales and toenails like cashew nuts. This piggy was the size of a pony. This piggy had tusks, and it wasn't pink. It was a blue-black colour and covered with sharp hair, but it did have, let's be fair, thought Colon, little red piggy eyes. This little piggy looked like the little piggy that killed the boarhounds, disemboweled the horse, and ate the huntsman. Colon turned around and came face to face with a bull-like beef cube on legs. It turned its huge head from side to side so that each rolling eye could get a sight of the sergeant. But it was clear that neither them liked him very much. It lowered its head. There wasn't room for it to charge, but it could certainly push. As the animals crowded around him, Colon took the only way of escape possible. There were men slumped all over the alley. Hello, 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 what's all this then? said Carrot. A man who was holding his arm and groaning looked up at him. We were viciously attacked. We don't have time for this, said Vimes. We may have, said Angua. She tapped him on the shoulder and pointed to the wall opposite, on which was written in a familiar script, No, Master. Carrot hunched down and spoke to the casualty. You were attacked by a golem, were you? he said. Right, vicious bugger. Just walked out of the fog and went for us. You know what they're like. Carrot gave the man a cheerful smile. Then his gaze travelled along the man's body to the big hammer lying in the gutter, and moved from that to the other tools strewn around the scene of the fight. Several had their handles broken. There was a long crowbar bent nearly into a circle. It's lucky you were all so well armed, he said. It turned on us, said the man. He tried to snap his fingers. Just like that. Oh, ah! You seem to have hurt your fingers. You're right. It's just that I don't understand how it could have turned on you and just walked out of the fog, said Carrot. Everyone knows they're not allowed to fight back. Fight back? Carrot repeated. It's not right them walking around the streets like that, the man muttered, looking away. There was the sound of running feet behind them, and a couple of men in blood-stained aprons caught up with them. It went that way, one yelled. You'll be able to catch up with it if you hurry. Come on, don't hang around. What do we pay our taxes for? said the other. It went all round the cattle yards and let everything out. Everything! You can't move on Pigsty Hill. A golem let all the cattle out, said Vimes. What for? 
How should I know? It took the Judas goat out of Fox Slaughterhouse, so half the damn things are following it around. And then it went and put old Fosdyke in his sausage machine. What? Oh, it didn't turn the handle. It just shoved a handful of parsley in his mouth, dropped an onion down his trousers, covered him in oatmeal, and dropped him in the upper. Angular's shoulders started to shake. Even Vimes grinned. And then it went into the poultry merchants, grabbed Mr. Turwilly, and... The man stopped, aware there was a lady present, even if she was making snorting noises while trying not to laugh, and continued in a mumble. Made use of some sage and onion, if you know what I mean. You mean he... Vimes began. Yes. His companion nodded. Poor old Turwilly won't be able to look sage and onion in the face again, I reckon. By the sound of it, that's the last thing he'll do, said Vimes. Angua had to turn her back. Tell him about what happened in your pork butchers, said the man's companion. I don't think you'll need to, said Vimes. I'm seeing a pattern here. Right, and poor young Sid's only an apprentice and didn't deserve what it done to him. Oh, dear, said Carrot. Uh, I think I've got an ointment that might be... Will it help with the apple? the man demanded. It shoved an apple in his mouth. Wrong! Vimes winced. Ouch! What's going to be done, eh? said the butcher, his face a few inches from Vimes's. Well, if you can get a grip on the stem... I'm serious! What are you going to do? I'm a taxpayer and I know my rights! He prodded Vimes in the breastplate. Vimes's expression went wooden. He looked down at the finger, and then back up at the man's large red nose. In that case, said Vimes, I suggest you take another apple, and, uh, excuse me, said Carrot loudly, you're Mr. Maxilot, aren't you? Got a shop in the shambles? Yes, that's right, what of it? It's just that I don't recall seeing your name on the register of taxpayers, which is very odd because you said you were a taxpayer, but of course you wouldn't lie about a thing like that, and anyway, when you paid your taxes, they would have given you a receipt, because that's the law and I'm sure you'd be able to find it if you looked. The butcher lowered his finger. Er, uh, yes. I could come and help you if you'd like, said Carrot. The butcher gave Vimes a despairing look. He really does read that stuff, said Vimes, for pleasure. Carrot, why don't you scop? My gods, what the hell is that? There was a bellow further up the street. Something big and muddy was approaching at a sort of menacing amble. In the gloom it looked vaguely like a very fat centaur, half man, half... In fact it was, he realised as it bounced nearer, half colon, half bull. Sergeant Colon had lost his helmet and had a certain look about him that suggested he had been close to the soil. As the massive bull cantered past, the sergeant rolled his eyes wildly and said, I daren't get off! I daren't get off! How did you get on? shouted Vimes. It wasn't easy, sir. I just grabbed the orange, sir. Next minute I was on his back. Well, hang on. Yes, sir. Hanging on, sir. Rogers the bulls were angry and bewildered, which counts as the basic state of mind for full-grown bulls. Because of the huge obtrusive mass of his forehead, Rogers the Bull's view of the universe was from two eyes each with their own non-overlapping hemispherical view of the world. Since there were two separate visions, Rogers had reasoned, that meant there must be two bulls, bulls not having been bred for much deductive reasoning. Most bulls believe this, which is why they always keep turning their head this way and that when they look at you. They do this because both of them want to see. But they had a particular reason. Beef cattle have a religion. They are deeply spiritual animals. They believe that good and obedient cattle go to a better place when they die through a magic door. They don't know what happens next, but they've heard that it involves really good eating and for some reason horseradish. Rogers had been quite looking forward to it. They were getting a bit creaky these days, and cows seemed to run faster than they had done when they were lads. They could just taste that heavenly horseradish and instead they'd been herded into a crowded pen for a day, and then the gate had been opened, and there'd been animals everywhere, and this did not look like the promised lard. And someone was on their back. They'd tried to buck him off a few times. In Rogers's heyday, the impudent man would by now be a few stringy red stains on the ground, but finally the arthritic bulls had given up until such time as they could find a handy tree on which to scrape him off.
They just wished the wretched man would stop yelling. Vimes took a few steps after the bull and then turned. Carrot, Angua, you two get down to Caddy's tallow works. Just keep an eye on it until we get there, understand? Spy out the place, but don't go in, understand? Right? Do not in any circumstances move in. Do I make myself clear? Just remain in the area, right? Yes, sir, said Carrot. Detritus, let's get Fred off that thing. The crowds were melting away ahead of the bull. A ton of pedigree bull does not experience traffic congestion, at least not for any length of time. Can't you jump off, Fred? Vimes yelled as he ran along behind. I do not wish to give that a try, sir. Well, can you steer it? How, sir? Take the bull by the horns, man. Colon tentatively reached out and took a horn in each hand. Rogers the bulls turned their head and nearly pulled him off. He's a bit stronger than me, sir. Quite a lot stronger, actually, sir. I could shoot it through the head with my bow, Mr. Vimes, said Detritus, flourishing his converted siege weapon. This is a crowded street, Sergeant. It might hit an innocent person, even in Alt Norpork. Sorry, sir, Detritus brightened, but if it did, we could always say they'd been guilty of something, sir. No, that... Uh, what's that chicken doing? A small black bantam cock raced up the street, ran between the bull's legs, and skidded to a halt just in front of Rogers. A smaller figure jumped off its back, leapt up, caught hold of the ring through the bull's nose, swung up further until it was in the mass of curls on the bull's forehead, and then took a firm hold of a lock of hair in each tiny hand. It looks like we mad Arthur de Gnome, sir, said Detritus. He trying to nut the bull. There was a noise like a slow woodpecker working on a particularly difficult tree, and it punctuated a litany of complaints from somewhere between the animal's eyes. Take that, you big lump that you are. The bulls stopped. They tried to turn their heads so that one or other of the Rogerses could see what the hell it was that was hammering at their foreheads, and might as well have tried looking down their own ears. They staggered backwards. Fred, Vimes whispered, you slip off its back while it's busy. With a panicky look, Sergeant Colan swung a leg over the bull's huge back and slid down to the ground. Vimes grabbed him and hustled him into a doorway. Then he hustled him out again. A doorway was far too confined a space in which to be anywhere near Fred Colon. Why are you all covered in crap, Fred? Well, sir, you know that creek you're up without a paddle? It started there and it got worse, sir. Good grief. Worse than that? Permission to go and have a bath, sir? No, but you could stand back a few more feet. What happened to your helmet? Last time I saw it, it was on a sheep, sir. Sir, I was tied up and shoved in a cellar and heroically broke free, sir. And I was chased by one of them golems, sir. Where was this? Colon had hoped he wouldn't be asked that. It was a place in the shambles, he said. It was foggy, so I... Um... Vimes grabbed Colon's wrists. What's this? They tied me up with string, sir, but at great personal risk of life and limb. Hey, this doesn't look like string to me, said Vimes. No, sir? No, this looks like candle wick. Colon looked blank. Is that a clue, sir? He said hopefully. There was a splatting noise as Vimes slapped him on the back. Well done, Fred, he said, wiping his hand on his trousers. It's certainly a corroboration. That's what I thought said Colan quickly. This is a corroboration, and I've got to get it to Commander Vines as soon as possible, regardless of... Why is that gnome nutting that bull, Fred? That's we mad Arthur, sir. We owe him a dollar. He was of some help, sir. Rogers the bulls were on their knees, dazed and bewildered. It wasn't that we mad Arthur was capable of delivering a killing blow, but he just didn't stop. After a while, the noise and the thumping got on people's nerves. Should we help him? said Vimes. Looks like he's doing all right by himself, sir, said Colan. We mad Arthur looked up and grinned. One dollar, right? he shouted. No Welsh in other come after you. One of these buggers trod on me grandpa once. Was he hurt? He got one of his arms twisted right off. Vimes took Sergeant Colan firmly by the arm. Cab on, Fred, it's all hitting the street now. Right, sir, and most of it's splashing. I say, you there, you're a watchman, aren't you? Come over here. Vimes turned. A man had pushed his way through the crowds. On the whole, Colon reflected, it was just possible that the worst moment of his life hadn't happened yet. Vimes tended to react in a ballistic way to words like, 
I say, you there, when uttered in a certain kind of neighing voice. The speaker had an aristocratic look about him, and the angry air of a man not accustomed to the rigours of life, who had just found one happening to him. Vimes saluted smartly. Yes, sir, I'm a watchman, sir. Well, just you come along with me and arrest this thing. It's disturbing the workers. What thing, sir? A golem man walked into the factory as bold as you like and started painting on the damn walls. What factory, sir? You come with me, my man. I happen to be a very good friend of your commander, and I can't say I like your attitude. Sorry about that, sir, said Vimes with a cheerfulness that Sergeant Colan had come to dread. There was a nondescript factory on the other side of the street. The man strode in. Er, uh, he said, Golem, sir, murmured Colan. Vimes had known Fred Colan a long time. Yes, Fred, so it's vitally important for you to stay on guard out here, he said. The relief rose off Colan like steam. That's right, sir, he said. The factory was full of sewing machines. People were sitting meekly in front of them. It was the sort of thing the guilds hated, but since the guild of seamstresses didn't take all that much interest in sewing, there was no one to object. Endless belts led up from each machine to pulleys on a long spindle near the roof, which in turn were driven by... Vimes's eyes followed it down the length of the workshop. A treadmill, now stationary and somewhat broken. A couple of golems were standing forlornly alongside it, looking lost. There was a hole in the wall quite close to it, and above it someone had written in red paint, Workers, no master but yourselves. Vimes grinned. It smashed its way in, broke the treadmill, pulled my golems out, painted that stupid message on the wall, and stamped out again, said the man behind him. Hmm, yes, I see. A lot of people use oxen in their treadmills, said Vimes mildly. What's that got to do with it? Anyway, cattle can't keep going for twenty-four hours a day. Vimes's gaze worked its way along the rows of workers. Their faces had that worried Cockbill Street look that you got when you were cursed with pride as well as poverty. No, indeed, he said. Most of the clothing workshops are up at Knapp Hill, but the wages are cheaper down here, aren't they? People are jolly glad to get the work. Yes, said Vimes, looking at the faces again. Glad. At the far end of the factory he noted the golems were trying to rebuild their treadmill. Now you listen to me. What I want you to do is, the factory owner began. Vimes's hand gripped his collar and dragged him forward until his face was a few inches from Vimes's own. No, you listen to me hissed Vimes. I mix with crooks and thieves and thugs all day, and that doesn't worry me at all, but after two minutes with you, I need a bath. And if I find that damn golem, I'll shake its damn hand. You hear me? To the surprise of that part of Vimes that wasn't raging, the man found enough courage to say, How dare you? You're supposed to be the law. Vimes is furious finger almost went up the man's nose. Where shall I start? he yelled. He glared at the two golems. And why are you clowns repairing the treadmill? he shouted. Good grief, haven't you got the sense you are bought? Haven't you got any sense? He stormed out of the building. Sergeant Colan stopped trying to scrape himself clean and ran to catch up with him. I heard some people say they saw a golem come out the other door, sir, he said. It was a red one, you know, red clay. But the one that was after me was white, sir. Are you angry, Sam? Who's the man that owns that place? That's Mr. Catterail, sir. You know, he's always writing you letters about there being too many what he calls lesser races in the watch. You know, trolls and dwarfs. The sergeant had to trot to keep up with him. Get some zombies, said Vimes. You've always been dead against zombies, excuse my pun, said Sergeant Colan. Any want to join, are there? Oh, yes, sir, a couple of good lads, sir. But for the grey skin hanging off them, you'd swear they hadn't been buried five minutes. Swear them in tomorrow. Right, sir, good idea. And of course it's a great saving not having to include them in the pension plan. They can patrol up on King's Down. After all, they're only human. Right, sir. When Sam is in these moods, Colon thought, you agree with everything. You really get in the hang of this affirmative action stuff, eh, sir? Right now I'd swear in a gorgon. 
There's always Mr. Bleakley, sir. He's getting fed up with working in the kosher butchers, and but no vampires. Never any vampires. Now, let's get a move on, Fred. Nobby Nobbs ought to have known. That's what he told himself as he scuttled through the streets. All that stuff about kings and stuff. They'd wanted him to... It was a terrible thought. Volunteer. Nobby had spent a lifetime in one uniform or another, and one of the most basic lessons he'd learned was that men with red faces and plummy voices never, ever gave cushy numbers to the likes of Nobby. They'd ask for volunteers to do something big and clean, and you'd end up scrubbing some damn great drawbridge. They'd say, anyone here like good food, and you'd be peeling potatoes for a week. You never, ever volunteered. Not even if a sergeant stood there and said, we need someone to drink alcohol, bottles of, and make love passionate to women for the use of. There was always a snag. If a choir of angels asked for volunteers for paradise to step forward, Nobby knew enough to take one smart pace to the rear. When the call came for Corporal Nobbs, it would not find him wanting. It would not find him at all. Nobby avoided a herd of pigs in the middle of the street. Even Mr. Vimes never expected him to volunteer. He respected Nobby's pride. Nobby's head ached. It must have been the quail's eggs, he was sure. They couldn't be healthy birds to lay titchy eggs like that. He sidled past a cow that had got its head stuck in someone's window. Nobby as king. Oh, yes. No one ever gave a knobs anything except maybe a skin disease or sixty lashes. It was a dog-eat-knobs world, right enough. If there were to be a world competition for losers, a knobs would come first, er, uh, last. He stopped running and went to earth in a doorway. In its welcome shadows, he extracted a very short cigarette end from behind his ear and lit it. Now that he felt safe enough to think about more than flight, he wondered about all the animals that seemed to be on the streets. Unlike the family tree that had borne Fred Colon as its fruit, the creeping vine of the Nobses had flourished only within city walls. Nobby was vaguely aware of animals as being food in a primary stage and left it at that, but he was pretty sure they weren't supposed to be wandering around untidily like this. Gangs of men were trying to round them up. Since they were tired and working at cross-purposes, and the animals were hungry and bewildered, all that was happening was that the streets were getting a lot muddier. Nobby became aware that he was not alone in the doorway. He looked down. Also lurking in the shadows was a goat. It was unkempt and smelly, but it turned its head and gave Nobby the most knowing look he'd ever seen on the face of an animal. Unexpectedly and most uncharacteristically, Nobby was struck by a surge of fellow feeling. He pinched out the end of his cigarette and passed it down to the goat, which ate it. You and me both, said Nobby. Miscellaneous livestock scattered madly as Carrot, Angua, and Cherie made their way down the shambles. They especially tried to keep away from Angua. It seemed to Cherie that an invisible barrier was advancing in front of them. Some animals tried to climb walls or scattered madly into side alleys. Why are they so scared? said Cherie. Can't imagine, said Angua. A few maddened sheep ran away from them as they walked around the candle factory. Light from its high windows indicated that candle-making continued all night. They make nearly half a million candles every twenty-four hours, said Carrot. I've heard they've got very advanced machinery. It sounds very interesting. I'd love to see it. At the rear of the premises, light blazed out into the fog. Crates of candles were being manhandled onto a succession of carts. Looks normal enough, said Carrot, as they eased themselves into a conveniently shadowy doorway. Busy, though. I don't see what good this is going to do, said Angua. As soon as they see us, they can destroy any evidence, and even if we find arsenic, so what? There's no crime in owning arsenic, is there? Ah, uh, is there a crime in owning that? whispered Cherie. A golem was walking slowly up the alley. It was quite unlike any other golem they'd seen. The others were ancient, and had repaired themselves so many times that they were as shapeless as a gingerbread man. But this one looked like a human, or at least like humans wished they could look. It resembled a statue made of white clay. Around its head, part of the very design was a crown. I was right, murmured Carrot. They did make themselves a golem. The poor devils. They thought a king would make them free. Look at its legs, said Angua. 
As the golem walked, lines of red light appeared and disappeared all over its legs and across its body and arms. It's cracking, she said. I knew you couldn't bake pottery in an old bread oven, said Cherie. It's not the right shape. The golem pushed open a door and disappeared into the factory. Let's go, said Carrot. Commander Vimes told us to wait for him, said Angua. Yes, but we don't know what might be going on in there, said Carrot. Besides, he likes us to use our initiative. We can't just hang around now. He darted across the alley and opened the door. There were crates piled inside with a narrow passageway between them. From all around them, but slightly muffled by the crates, came the clicking and rattling of the factory. The air smelled of hot wax. Cherie was aware of a whispered conversation going on several feet above her little round helmet. I wish Mr. Vimes hadn't wanted us to bring her, supposing something happens to her. What are you talking about? Well, you know, she's a girl. So what? There's at least three female dwarfs in the watch already, and you don't worry about them. Oh, come on, name one. Last skull drinker for a start? No. Really? Are you calling this nose a liar? But he broke up a fight at the miners' arms single-handedly last week. Well, why do you assume females are weaker? You wouldn't worry about me taking on a vicious bar crowd by myself. I'd give aid where necessary. To me or to them? Oh, that's unfair, is it? I wouldn't help them unless you got really rough. Oh, so. And they say chivalry is dead. Anyway, Cherie is, is a bit different. I'm sure he, she's good at alchemy, but we'd better watch her back in a fight. Hold on. They stepped out into the factory. Candles whirled overhead, hundreds of them, thousands of them, dangling by their wicks from an endless belt of complex wooden links that switch-backed its way up and down the long hall. I heard about this, said Carrot. It's called a producing line. It's a way of making thousands of things that are all the same. But look at the speed. I'm amazed the treadmill can... Angua pointed. There was a treadmill creaking around beside her, but there was nothing inside it. Something's got to be powering all this, said Angua. Carrot pointed. Further up the hall, the switchbacks of the line converged in a complicated knot. There was a figure somewhere in the middle, arms moving in a blur. Just beside Carrot, the line ended at a big wooden hopper. Candles cascaded into it. No one had been emptying it, and they were tumbling over the pile and rolling onto the floor. Cherie, said Carrot, do you know how to use any kind of weapon? Er, uh, no, Captain Carrot. Right, you just wait in the alley, then. I don't want any harm coming to you. She scuttled off, looking relieved. Angua sniffed the air. There's been a vampire here, she said. I think we'd... Carrot began. Ah, I knew you'd find out. Ah, I wish I'd never bought the damn thing. I, I've got a bow. I, I warn you, I've got a crossbow. They turned. Ah, oh, Mr. Carry, said Carrot cheerfully. He produced his badge. Captain Carrot, Ankh-Mor Pork City Watch. Oh, I know who you are. I know who you are and what you are, too. Oh, I knew you'd come. I've got a bow and I'm not afraid to use it. The crossbow's point moved uncertainly proving him a liar. Really, said Angua, what we are? I didn't even want to get involved, said Carrie. It killed those old men, didn't it? Yes, said Carrot. Well, why? I didn't tell it to. Because they helped make it, I think, said Carrot. It knew who to blame. The, the golems sold it to me, said Carrie. I thought it had helped build up the business, but the damn thing... Don't stop! He glanced up at the line of candles whirring overhead, but jerked his head back before Angua could move. Works hard, does it? Ha! <laughs> but Carrie didn't look like a man enjoying a joke. He looked like a man in private torment. I've laid off everyone except the girls in the packing department, and they're on three shifts and overtime. I've got four men out looking for tallow, two negotiating for wicks, and three trying to buy more storage space. Then get it to stop making candles, said Carrot. It goes off into the streets when we run out of tallow. You want it walking around looking for something to do? Hey, you two stay together, Carrie added urgently, waving the crossbow. Look, all you have to do is change the words in its head, said Carrot. It won't let me. Don't you think I've tried? It can't not let you, said Carrot. Golems have to let... I said it, it won't let me. What about the poisoned candles, said Carrot. That wasn't my idea. Whose idea was it? 
Carrie's crossbow swung back and forth. He licked his lips. This has all gone far too far, he said. I'm getting out. Whose idea, Mr. Carey? I'm not going to end up in some alley somewhere with as much blood as a banana. Now then, we wouldn't do anything like that, said Carrot. Mr. Carey was exporting terror. Angua could smell it streaming off him. He might pull the trigger out of sheer panic. There was another smell, too. Who's the vampire? she said. For a moment she thought the man would fire the crossbow. Ah, I never said anything about him. You've got garlic in your pocket, said Angua, and the place reeks of vampire. He said we could get the golem to do anything, Carrie mumbled. Like making poisoned candles, said Carrot. Yes, but he said it'd just keep Vetinari out of the way, said Carrie. He seemed to be getting a tenuous grip on himself. And he's not dead, because I'd have heard, he said. I shouldn't think making him ill is a crime, so you can't. The candles killed two other people, said Carrot. Carrie started to panic again. Who? An old lady and a baby in Cockbill Street. Uh, uh, were they important? said Carrie. Carrot nodded to himself. I was almost feeling sorry for you, he said, right up to that point. You're a lucky man, Mr. Carrie. You think so? Oh, yes. We got to you before Commander Vimes did. Now, just put down the crossbow and we can talk about it. There was a noise, or rather the sudden cessation of a noise that had been so pervasive that it had no longer been consciously heard. The clacking line had stopped. There was a chorus of little waxy thuds as the hanging candles swung and hit one another, and then silence unrolled. The last candle dropped off the line, tumbled down the heap in the hopper, and bounced on the floor. And in the silence, the sound of footsteps. Carrie started to back away. Oh, too late, he moaned. Both Carrot and Angua saw his finger move. Angua pushed Carrot out of the way as the claw released the string. But he had anticipated this, and his hand was already flinging itself up and across. She heard the sickening tearing noise as his palm whirled in front of her face, and his grunt as the force of the bolt spun him round. He landed heavily on the floor, clutching his left hand. The crossbow bolt was sticking out of the palm. Angua crouched down. It doesn't look barbed. Let me pull it. Carrot grabbed her wrist. The point's silver. Don't touch it. They both looked up as a shadow crossed the light. The king golem looked down at her. She felt her teeth and fingernails begin to lengthen. Then she saw the small round face of Cherie peering nervously around a pile of crates. Angua fought down her werewolf instincts, screamed stay right there at the dwarf and at every swelling hair follicle, and hesitated between pursuing the fleeing Carrie and dragging Carrot to safety. She told her body again that a wolf shape was not an option. There were too many strange smells, too many fires. The golem glistened with tallow and wax. She backed away. Behind the golem, she saw Cherie look down at the groaning Carrot and then up at a fire axe hooked on the wall. The dwarf took it down and weighed it vaguely in her hands. Don't try, Angua began. Oh no, moaned Carrot, not that one. Cherie came up behind the golem at a run and hacked at its waist. The axe rebounded, but she pirouetted with it and caught the statue on the thigh, chipping off a piece of clay. Angua hesitated. Cherie's axe was making blurred orbits around the golem, while its wielder yelled more terrible battle cries. Angua couldn't make out any words, but many dwarf cries didn't bother with words. They went straight for emotions in sonic form. Chips of pottery ricocheted off the crates as each blow landed. What did she yell? Angua said as she pulled Carrot out of the way. It's the most menacing dwarf battle cry there is. Once it's been shouted, someone has to be killed. What's it mean? Today is a good day for someone else to die. The golem watched the dwarf incuriously, like an elephant watching an attack by a rogue chicken. Then it picked the axe out of the air, Cherie trailing behind it like a comet, and hurled it aside. Angua hauled Carrot to his feet. Blood dripped from his hand. She tried to shut her nostrils. Full moon tomorrow. No more choices. Maybe we can reason with it, Carrot started. Attention, this is the real world calling, shouted Angua. Carrot drew his sword. I am arresting you, he began. The golem's arm whirred across. The sword buried itself to the hilt in a crate of candles. Got any more clever ideas, said Angua, as they backed away, or can we go now? 
No, we've got to stop it somewhere. Their heels met a wall of crates. I think we found the place, said Angua, as the golem raised its fists again. You duck right, I'll duck left. Maybe a blow rocked the big double doors in the far wall. The king golem's head turned. The doors shook again and burst inwards. For a moment, Dorful was framed in the doorway. Then the red golem lowered his head, spread his arms, and charged. It wasn't a very fast run, but it did have a terrible momentum, like the slow slide of a glacier. The floorboards shook and drummed under him. The golems collided with a clang in the middle of the floor. Jagged lines of fire spread across the king's body as cracks opened, but it roared and caught up Dorful round the middle and tossed him against the wall. Come on, said Angua. Now can we find Cherie and get out of here? We ought to help him, said Carrot, as the golems smashed into each other again. How? If it, if he can't stop it, what makes you think we can? Come on! Carrot shook her off. Dorful picked itself up from among the bricks and charged again. The golems met, scrabbling at one another for purchase. They stood locked for a moment, creaking, and then Dorful's hand came up holding something. Dorful pushed himself back and smashed the other golem over the head with its own leg. As it spun, Dorful's other hand lashed out, but was grabbed. The king swiveled with a strange grace, bore Dorful to the floor, rolled and kicked out. Dorful rolled too. He flung out his arms to stop himself and looked back to see both his feet pinwheeling into the wall. The king picked up its own leg, balanced for a moment, and joined itself together. Then its red gaze swept the factory and flared when it caught sight of Carrot. There must be a back way out of here, muttered Angua. Carry got out. The king started to run after them, but hit an immediate problem. It had put its leg on back to front. It began to limp in a circle, but somehow the circle got nearer to them. We can't just leave Dorful lying there, said Carrot. He pulled a long metal rod out of a stirring tank and eased himself back down to the grease-crusted floor. The king rocked towards him. Carrot hopped backwards, steadying himself on a rail, and swung. The golem lifted its hand, caught the rod out of the air, and tossed it aside. It raised both fists and tried to step forward. It couldn't move. It looked down. <sharp inhale> said what remained of Dorful, gripping its ankle. The king bent, swung one hand with the palm edgewise, and calmly sheared the top off Dorful's head. It removed the chem and crumpled it up. The glow died in Dorful's eyes. Angua cannoned into Carrot so hard he almost fell over. She wrapped both arms around him and pulled him after her. It just killed Dorful, just like that, said Carrot. It's a shame, yes, said Angua, or it would be if Dorful had been alive. Carrot, they're like machinery. Look, can we make it to the door? Carrot shook himself free. It's murder, he said. We're watchmen. We can't just watch. It killed him. It's an it. And so's he. Commander Vimes said someone has to speak for the people with no voices. He really believes it, Angua thought. Vimes puts words in his head. Keep it occupied, he shouted and darted away. How? Organize a sing-song? I've got a plan. Oh, good. Vimes looked up at the entrance of the candle factory. He could dimly see two cressets burning on either side of a shield. Look at that, will you? he said. Paint not dry, and he flaunts the thing for all the world to see. What's that, sir? said Detritus. His damn coat of arms. Detritus looked up. Why's it got a lighted fish on it? he said. In heraldry, that's a poisson, said Vimes bitterly, and it's supposed to be a lamp. A lamp made out of a poisson, said Detritus. Well, there's a thing. At least he's got the motto in proper language, said Sergeant Colon. Instead of all the old-fashioned stuff no one understands, art brought forth the candle. That, Sergeant Detritus, is a pun, or play on words, cause his name is Arthur, see? Vimes stood between the two sergeants and felt a hole open up in his head. Damn, he said. Damn, damn, damn. He showed it to me. Dumb plodder Vimes, he won't notice. Oh, yes, and he was right. It's not that good, said Colon. I mean, you've got to know that Mr. Carey's first name is Arthur. Shut up, Fred, snapped Vimes. Shut up right now, sir. The arrogance of... Who's that? A figure darted out of the building, glanced around hurriedly, and scurried along the street.
That's Carrie, said Vimes. He didn't even shout after him, but went from a standing start to a full run. The fleeing figure dodged between the occasional straying sheep or pig, and didn't have a bad turn of speed, but Vimes was powered by sheer anger, and was only yards away when Carrie ducked into an alleyway. Vimes skidded to a halt and grabbed at the wall. He'd seen the shape of a crossbow, and one of the things you learned in the watch, that is, one of the things which hopefully you'd have a chance to learn, was that it was a very stupid thing indeed to follow someone with a crossbow into a dark alley where you'd be outlined against any light there was. I know it's you, Carrie, he shouted. I've got a crossbow. You can only fire it once. I want to turn King's evidence. Guess again. Carrie lowered his voice. They just said I could get the damn golem to do it. I didn't think anyone was going to get hurt. Right, right, said Vimes. You made poison candles because they gave a better light, I expect. You know what I mean. They told me it would be all right and... Which they would they be? They said no one would ever find out. Really? Look, look, they said they could... The voice paused and took on that wheedling tone the blunt-witted use when they're trying to sound sharp. If I tell you everything, you'll let me go, right? The two sergeants had caught up. Vimes pulled detritus towards him, although in fact he ended up pulling himself towards detritus. Go round the corner and see he doesn't come out of the alley the other way, he whispered. The troll nodded. What's it you want to tell me, Mr. Carey? said Vimes to the darkness in the alley. Have we got a bargain? What? A bargain? No, we damn well haven't got a bargain, Mr. Carey. I'm not a tradesman. But I'll tell you something, Mr. Carey. They betrayed you. There was a silence from the darkness, and then a sound like a sigh. Behind Vimes, Sergeant Colon stamped his feet on the cobbles to keep warm. You can't stay in there all night, Mr. Carey, said Vimes. There was another sound, a leathery sound. Vimes glanced up into the coils of fog. Something's not right, he said. Come on. He ran into the alley. Sergeant Colon followed on the basis that it was fine to run into an alley containing an armed man, provided you were behind someone else. A shape loomed at them. Detritus? Yes, sir. Where did he go? There are no doors in the alley. Then his eyes grew more accustomed to the gloom. He saw a huddled outline at the foot of a wall, and his foot nudged a crossbow. Mr. Carey? He knelt down and lit a match. Oh, nasty, said Sergeant Colon. Something's broken his neck. Dead, is he? said Detritus. You want I should draw a chalk outline round him? I don't think we need bother, Sergeant. It's no bother. I've got the chalk right here. Vimes looked up. Fog filled the alley, but there were no ladders, no handy low roofs. Let's get out of here, he said. Angua faced the king. She resisted a terrible urge to change. Even a werewolf's jaws probably wouldn't have any effect on the thing. It didn't have a jugular. She daren't look away. The king moved uncertainly with little jerks and twitches that in a human would suggest madness. Its arms moved fast, but erratically, as if signals that were being sent were not arriving properly. And Dorfel's attack had left it damaged. Every time it moved, red light shone from dozens of new cracks. You're cracking up, she shouted. The oven wasn't right for pottery. The king lunged at her. She dodged and heard its hand slice through a rack of candles. You're cranky. You're baked like a loaf. You're half-baked. She drew her sword. She didn't usually have much use for it. She found a smile would invariably do the trick. A hand sliced the top off the blade. She stared at the sheared metal in horror, and then somersaulted back as another blow hummed past her face. Her foot rolled on a candle, and she fell heavily, but with enough presence of mind to roll before a foot stamped down. Where have you gone? she yelled. Can you get it to move a little closer to the doors, please? said a voice from the darkness on high. Carrot crawled out along the rickety structure that supported the production line. Carrot! Almost there! The king grabbed at her leg. She lashed out with her foot and caught it on the knee. To her amazement, she made it crack. But the fire below was still there. The pieces of pottery seemed to float on it. No matter what anyone did, the golem could keep going, even if it were just a cloud of dust held together. Ah, right, said Carrot, and dropped off the gantry. He landed on the king's back, flung one arm around its neck, and began to pound on its head with the hilt of his sword. It staggered and tried to reach up to pull him off. Got to get the words out! Carrot shouted as the arms flailed at him. It's the only way! 
The king staggered forward and hit a stack of boxes which burst and rained candles over the floor. Carrot grabbed its ears and tried to twist. Angua heard him saying, You have the right to a lawyer? Carrot, don't bother with its damn rights. You have the right to just give it the last ones. There was a commotion in the gaping doorway and Vimes ran in, sword drawn. Oh, gods! Sergeant Detritus! Detritus appeared behind him. Sir! Crossbow bolt through the head, if you please. If you say so, sir! It's head, Sergeant. Mine is fine. Carrot, get down off the thing! Can't get its head off, sir! We'll try six feet of cold steel in the ear just as soon as you let the damn thing go! Carrot steadied himself on the king's shoulders, tried to judge his moment as the thing staggered around, and leapt. He landed awkwardly on a sliding heap of candles. His leg buckled under him, and he tumbled over until he was stopped by the inert shell that had been dorful. Hey, look this way, mister, said Detritus. The king turned. Vimes didn't catch everything that happened next because it all happened so quickly. He was merely aware of the rush of air and the gloink of the rebounding bolt mingling with the wooden juddering noise as it buried itself in the doorframe behind him and the golem was crouching down by Carrot, who was trying to squirm out of the way. It raised a fist and brought it down. Vimes didn't even see Dorfel's arm move, but there it was, there, suddenly gripping the king's wrist. Tiny stars of light went nova in Dorfel's eyes. <sighs> As the king jerked back in surprise, Dorfel held on and levered himself up on what remained of his legs. As he came up, so did his fist. Time slowed. Nothing moved in the whole universe but Dorfel's fist. It swung like a planet, without any apparent speed, but with a drifting unstoppability. And then the king's expression changed. Just before the fist landed, it, it smiled. The golem's head exploded. Vimes recalled it in slow motion, one long second of floating pottery. And words... Scraps of paper flew out, dozens, scores of them, tumbling gently to the floor. Slowly, peacefully, the king hit the floor. The red light died, the cracks opened, and then there were just pieces. Dorfel collapsed on top of them. Angua and Vimes reached Carrot together. He came alive, said Carrot, struggling up. That thing was going to kill me, and Dorfel came alive. But that thing had smashed the words out of his head. A golem has to have the words. They gave their own golem too many, I can see that, said Vimes. He picked up some of the coils of paper. Create peace and justice for all. Rule us wisely. Teach us freedom. Lead us to... Poor devil, he thought. Let's get you home. That hand needs treating, said Angua. Listen, will you? said Carrot. He's alive! Vimes knelt down by Dorfel. The broken clay skull looked as empty as yesterday's breakfast egg, but there was still a pinpoint of light in each eye socket. <clears throat> hissed Dorfel, so faintly that Vimes wasn't sure he'd heard it. A finger scratched on the floor. Is it trying to write something? said Angua. Vimes pulled out his notebook, eased it under Dorfel's hand, and gently pushed a pencil into the golem's fingers. They watched the hand as it wrote, a little jerkily, but still with the mechanical precision of a golem, eight words. Then it stopped. The pencil rolled away. The lights in Dorfel's eyes dwindled and went out. Good grief, breathed Angua. They don't need words in their heads. We can rebuild him, said Carrot hoarsely. We have the pottery. Vimes stared at the words, and then at what remained of Dorfel. Mr. Vimes, said Carrot. Do it, said Vimes. Carrot blinked. Right now, Vimes said. He looked back at the scroll in his book. Words in the heart can not be taken. And when you rebuild him, he said, when you rebuild him, give him a voice, understand? And get someone to look at your hand. A voice, sir? Do it. Yes, sir. Right. Vimes pulled himself together. Constable Angua and I will have a look around here. Off you go. He watched Carrot and the troll carry the remains out. OK, he said. We're looking for arsenic. Maybe there'll be some workshop somewhere. I shouldn't think they'd want to mix the poison candles up with the others. Cheery'll know what. Where is Corporal Littlebottom? 
Uh, I don't think I can hold on much longer. They looked up. Cherie was hanging on the line of candles. How did you get up there? said Vimes. I sort of found myself going past, sir. Can't you just let go? You're not that high. Oh. A big trough of molten tallow was a few feet under her. Occasionally the surface went gloop. Er, uh, how hot would that be? Vimes hissed to Angua. Ever bitten hot jam? she said. Vimes raised his voice. Can't you swing yourself along, Corporal? All the wood's greasy, sir. Corporal Littlebottom, I order you not to fall off. Very good, sir. Vimes pulled off his jacket. Hang on to this. I'll see if I can climb up, he muttered. It won't work, said Angua. The thing's shaky enough as it is. I can feel my hand slipping, sir. Good grief, why didn't you call out earlier? Everyone seemed to be busy, sir. Turn around, sir, said Angua, undoing the buckles of her breastplate. Right now, please, and shut your eyes. Why? What? Right now, Oh, yes. Vimes heard Angua back away from the candle machine, her footsteps punctuated by the clang of falling armour. Then she started running, and the footsteps changed while she was running, and then he opened his eyes. The wolf sailed upwards in slow motion, caught the dwarf's shoulder in its jaws as Cherie's grip gave way, and then arched its body so that the wolf and dwarf hit the floor on the far side of the vat. Angua rolled, whimpering. Cherie scrambled to her feet. It's a werewolf! Angua rolled back and forth, pawing at her mouth. What's happened to it? said Cherie, her panic receding a little. It looks hurt. Where's Angua? Oh. Vimes glanced at the dwarf's torn leather shirt. You wear chainmail under your clothes, he said. Oh, it's my silver vest. But she knew about it, I told her. Vimes grabbed Angua's collar. She moved to bite him, and then caught his eye and turned her head away. Oh, she only bit the silver, said Cherie, distractedly. Angua pulled herself onto her feet, glared at them, and slunk off behind some crates. They heard her whimpering, which by degrees became a voice. Oh, blasted dwarfs and their blasted vests. You all right, constable? said Vimes. Damn silver underwear. <sighs> Can you throw me my clothes, please? Vimes bundled up Angua's uniform, and eyes closed for decency's sake, handed it around the crates. No one told me she was a werewolf, Cherie moaned. Look at it like this, Corporal, said Vimes, as patiently as he could. If she hadn't been a werewolf, you would by now be the world's largest novelty candle, all right? Angua walked from behind the crates, rubbing her mouth. The skin around it looked too pink. It burned you, said Cherie. It'll heal, said Angua. You never said you were a werewolf. How would you have liked me to put it? Right, said Vimes. If that's all sorted out, ladies, I want this place searched. Understand? I've got some ointment, said Cherie meekly. Thank you. They found a bag in a cellar. There were several boxes of candles and a lot of dead rats. Igneous the Troll opened the door of his pottery a fraction. He'd intended the fraction to be no more than about one-sixteenth, but someone immediately pushed hard and turned it into rather more than one and three-quarters. Dear, what's this? he said, as Detritus and Carrot came in with the shell of Dorful between them. You can't just break in here. We ain't just breaking in, said Detritus. This is an outrage, said Igneous. You got no right coming in here. You got no reason. Detritus let go of the golem and spun around. His hand shot out and caught Igneous around the throat. You see those statues of monolith over there? You see them? He growled, twisting the other troll's head to face a row of troll religious statues on the other side of the warehouse. You want I shall smash one open, see what they're filled with? Maybe find a reason? Igneous's slitted eyes darted this way and that. He might have been hard of thinking, but he could feel a killing mood when it was in the air. No call for that. I always help the watch, he muttered. What this all about? Carrot laid out the golem on a table. Start, then, he said. Rebuild him. Use as much of the old clay as you can. Understand? How can it work when its lights are out? said Detritus, still puzzled by this mission of mercy. He said the clay remembers. The sergeant shrugged. 
and give him a tongue, said Carrot. Igneous looked shocked. I won't do that, he said. Everybody know it blasphemy if golems speak. Oh, yeah, said Detritus. He strode across the warehouse to the group of statues and glared at them. Then he said, Whoops, here's me accidentally tripping up. Ooh, this is me grabbing a statue for support. Oh, their arm have come right off. Where can I put my face? And what is this white powder? What I sees here with my eyes accidentally spilling on the floor. He licked a finger and gingerly tasted the stuff. Slab, he growled, walking back to the trembling Igneous. You telling me about blasphemy, you sedimentary coprolith. You doing what Captain Carrot say right now, or you going out of here in a sack? This is police brutality, Igneous muttered. No, no, this is just police shouting, yelled Detritus. You want to try for brutality, it's okay with me. Igneous tried to appeal to Carrot. It not right. He got a badge. He's putting me in fear. He can't do this, he said. Carrot nodded. There was a glint in his eye that Igneous should have noticed. That's correct, he said. Sergeant Detritus? Sir, it's been a long day for all of us. You can go off duty. Yes, sir, said Detritus with considerable enthusiasm. He moved his badge and laid it down carefully. Then he started to struggle out of his armour. Look at it like this, said Carrot. It's not that we're making life, we're simply giving life a place to live. Igneous finally gave up. Okay, okay, he muttered. I'm doing it, I'm doing it. He looked at the various lumps and shards that were all that remained of Dorful and rubbed the lichen on his chin. You got most of the bits, he said, professionalism edging resentment aside for a moment. I could glue him together with kiln cement. That'll do the trick if we bakes him overnight. Let's see, I reckon I got some over there. Detritus blinked at his finger, which was still white with the dust, and sidled over to Carrot. Did I just lick this? he said. Er, uh, yes, said Carrot. Thank goodness for that, said Detritus, blinking furiously. I'd hate to believe this room was really full of giant, hairy spider, e weeble, weeble sclop. He hit the floor, but happily. Even if I do it, you can't make it come alive again, muttered Igneous, returning to his bench. You won't find a priest who's going to write the words for in the head, not again. He'll make up his own words, said Carrot. And who's going to watch the oven, said Igneous. It's going to take till breakfast at least. I wasn't planning on doing anything for the rest of tonight, said Carrot, taking off his helmet. Vimes awoke around four o'clock. He'd gone to sleep at his desk. He hadn't meant to, but his body had just shut down. It wasn't the first time he'd opened bleary eyes there, but at least he wasn't lying in anything sticky. He focused on the report he'd half-written. His notebook was beside it, page after page of laborious scrawl, to remind him he was trying to understand a complex world by means of his simple mind. He yawned and looked out at the shank of the night. He didn't have... Any evidence. No real evidence at all. He'd had an interview with an almost incoherent Corporal Nobbs, who hadn't really seen anything. He had nothing that wouldn't burn away like the fog in the morning. All he'd got were a few suspicions and a lot of coincidences, leaning against one another like a house of cards with no card on the bottom. He peered at his notebook. Someone seemed to have been working hard. Oh, yes, it had been him. The events of last night jangled in his head. Why had he written all this stuff about a coat of arms? Oh, yes, yes! Ten minutes later, he was pushing open the door of the pottery. Warmth spilt out into the clammy air. He found Carrot and Detritus asleep on the floor on either side of the kiln. Damn! He needed someone he could trust, but he hadn't the heart to wake them. He pushed everyone very hard the last few days. Something tapped on the door of the kiln. Then the handle started to turn by itself. The door opened as far as it could go, and something half slid and half fell onto the floor. Vimes still wasn't properly awake. Exhaustion and the importunate ghosts of adrenaline sizzled around the edges of his consciousness. But he saw the burning man unfold himself and stand upright. His red-hot body gave little pings as it began to cool. Where it stood, the floor charred and smoked. 
The golem raised his head and looked around. You, said Vimes, pointing an unsteady finger, come with me. Yes, said Dorful. Dragon King of Arms stepped into his library. The dirt of the small high windows and the remnants of the fog made sure there was never more than greyness here, but a hundred candles yielded their soft light. He sat down at his desk, pulled a volume towards him, and began to write. After a while he stopped and stared ahead of him. There was no sound but the occasional spluttering of a candle. Ah, I can smell you, Commander Vimes, he said. Did the heralds let you in? I found my own way, thank you, said Vimes, stepping out of the shadows. The vampire sniffed again. You came alone? Who should I have brought with me? And to what do I owe the pleasure, Sir Samuel? The pleasure is all mine. I'm going to arrest you, said Vimes. Oh, dear. Uh, uh, for what, may I ask? Can I invite you to notice the arrow in this crossbow, said Vimes. No metal on the point, you'll see. It's wood all the way. How very considerate, sir. Dragon King of Arms twinkled at him. You still haven't told me what I'm accused of, however. To start with, complicity in the murders of Mrs. Flora Easy and the child William Easy. I am afraid those names mean nothing to me. Vimes's finger twitched on the bow's trigger. No, he said, breathing deeply. They probably don't. We are making other inquiries, and there may be a number of additional matters. The fact that you were poisoning the patrician, I consider a mitigating circumstance. You really intend to prefer charges? I'd prefer violence, said Vimes loudly. Charges is what I'm going to have to settle for. The vampire leaned back. I hear you've been working very hard, Commander he said, so I will not... We've got the testimony of Mr. Carey, lied Vimes, the late Mr. Carey. Dragon's expression changed by not one tiny tremor of muscle. I really do not know <laughs> what you're talking about, Sir Samuel. Only someone who could fly could have got into my office. I'm afraid you've lost me, sir. Mr. Carey was killed tonight, Vimes went on, by someone who could get out of an alley guarded at both ends, and I know a vampire was in his factory. I am still gamely trying to understand you, Commander, said Dragon King of Arms. I know nothing about the death of Mr. Carey, and in any case there are a great many vampires in the city. I am afraid your... Mm -hmm, Aversion is well known. I don't like to see people treated like cattle, said Vimes. He stared briefly at the volumes piled in the room. And of course that's what you've always done, isn't it? These are the stock books of Aunt Morpork. The crossbow swung back towards the vampire, who hadn't moved. Power over little people, that's what vampires want. The blood is just a way of keeping score. I wonder how much influence you've had over the years. A little. You are correct there, at least. A person of breeding, said Vimes. Good grief. Well, I think people wanted Vetinari out of the way, but not dead yet. Too many things had happened too fast if he were dead. Is Nobby really an earl? The evidence suggests so. But it's your evidence, right? You see, I don't think he's got noble blood in him. Nobby's as common as muck. It's one of his better points. I don't set any score by the ring. The amount of stuff his family's nicked, you could probably prove he's the Duke of Pseudopolis, the Seraph of Clatch, and the Dowager Duchess of Quirm. He pinched my cigar case last year, and I'm damn certain he's not me. No, I don't think Nobby is a knob. But I think he was convenient. It seemed to Vimes that Dragon was getting bigger, but perhaps it was only a trick of the candlelight. The light flickered as the candles hissed and popped. You made good use of me, eh? 
Vimes carried on. I'd been ducking out of appointments with you for weeks. I expect you were getting quite impatient. You were so surprised when I told you about Nobby, eh? Otherwise you'd have had to send for him or something very suspicious. But Commander Vimes discovered him. That looks good. Practically makes it official. And then I started thinking, who wants a king? Well, nearly everyone. It's built in. Kings make it better. Funny thing, isn't it? Even those people who owe everything to him don't like Vetinari. Ten years ago, most of the guild leaders were just a bunch of thugs. And now, well, they're still a bunch of thugs, to tell the truth. But Vetinari's given them the time and energy to decide they never needed him. And then young Carrot turns up with charisma writ all over him. And he's got a sword and a birthmark, and everyone gets a funny feeling, and dozens of buggers start going through the records and say, Hey, looks like the king's come back. And then they watch him for a while and say, Shit, he really is decent and honest and fair and just. Just like in all the stories. Whoops, oh, if this lad gets on the throne, we could be in serious trouble. He might turn out to be one of them inconvenient kings from long ago, who wanders around talking to the common people. You are in favour of the common people, said Dragon, mildly. The common people, said Vimes. They're nothing special. They're no different from the rich and powerful, except they've got no money or power. But the law should be there to balance things up a bit, so I suppose I've got to be on their side. A man married to the richest woman in the city? Vimes shrugged. The watchman's helmet isn't like a crown. Even when you take it off, you're still wearing it. That's an interesting statement of position, Sir Samuel. I would be the first to admire the way you've come to terms with your family history. But don't move. Vimes shifted his grip on the crossbow. Anyway... Carrot wouldn't do, but the news was getting around, and someone said, Right, let's have a king we can control. All the rumours say the king is a humble watchman, so let's find one. And they had a look and found that when it comes to humble, you can't beat Nobby Nobs. But <laughs> I think people weren't too sure. Killing Vetinari wasn't an option. As I said, too many things would happen too fast. But to just... Gently remove him so that he's there and not there at the same time, while everyone tried out the idea. That was a good wheeze. That's when someone got Mr. Carey to make poison candles. He'd got a golem. Golems can't talk. No one would know. But it turned out to be a bit erratic. You seem to wish to involve me said Dragon King of Arms. I know nothing about this man other than that he's a customer. Vimes strode across the room and pulled a piece of parchment from a board. You did him a coat of arms, he shouted. You even showed me when I was here. The butcher, the baker and the candlestick maker, remember? There was no sound now from the hunched figure. When I first met you the other day, said Vimes, you made a point of showing me Arthur Carey's coat of arms. I thought it was a bit fishy at the time, but all that business with Nobby put it out of my mind. But I do remember it reminded me of the one for the Assassin's Guild. Vimes flourished the parchment. I looked and looked at it last night, and then I wound my sense of humour down ten notches and let it go out of focus and looked at the crest, the fish-shaped lamp. Lamp. Au poisson, it's called. A sort of bilingual play on words, perhaps? A lamp of poison? You've got to have a mind like old detritus to spot that one. And Fred Colon wondered why you'd left the motto in modern Enkian instead of putting it into the old language. And that made me wonder. So I sat up with the dictionary and worked it out, and you know, it would have read Ars Enixar Est Candelam. Ars Enixar. That must have really cheered you up. You'd said who did it and how it was done, and gave it to the poor bugger to be proud of. Didn't matter that no one else would spot it, it made you feel good, because we ordinary mortals just aren't as clever as you, are we? He shook his head. Good grief, a coat of arms. Was that the bribe? Was that all it took? Dragon slumped in his chair. And then I wondered what was in it for you? continued Vimes. Oh, there's a lot of people involved, I expect, for the same old reasons, but you. Now, my wife breeds dragons. 
Out of interest, really. Is that what you do? A little hobby to allow the centuries to fly by? Or does blue blood taste sweeter? You know, I hope it was some reason like that. Some decent, mad, selfish one. Uh, possibly. If someone were so inclined, and I certainly make no such admission, <laughs> they might simply be thinking of improving the race, said the shape in the shadows. Breeding for receding chins or bunny teeth, that sort of thing, said Vimes. Yes, I can see where it would be more straightforward if you had the whole king business. All those courtly balls, all those little arrangements which see to it that the right kind of girl meets only the right kind of boy. You've had hundreds of years, right? And everyone consults you. You know where all the family trees are planted. But it's all got a bit messy under Vetinari, hasn't it? All the wrong people are getting to the top. I know how Sybil curses when people leave the pen gates open. It really messes up her breeding programme. You are wrong about Captain Carrot. <laughs> the city knows how to work around mm, difficult kings, but would it want a future king who might really be called Rex? Vimes looked blank. There was a sigh from the shadows. I am, uh, referring to his apparently stable relationship with the werewolf. Vimes stared. Understanding eventually dawned. You think they'd have puppies? The genetics of werewolves are not straightforward, <laughs> but the chance of such an outcome would be considered mm, unacceptable. If someone were thinking on those lines, by gods, and that's it. The shadows were changing. Dragon was still slumped in the chair, but his outline seemed to be blurring. Whatever the uh, motives, Mr. Vimes, there is no evidence other than supposition and coincidence, and your will to believe, that links me with any attempt on Betinari's <laughs> life. The old vampire's head was sunk even further in his chest. The shadows of his shoulders seemed to be getting longer. It was sick involving the golems, said Vimes, watching the shadows. They could feel what their king was doing. Perhaps it wasn't very sane even to begin with, but it was all they had. Clay of their clay. The poor devils didn't have anything except their clay, and you bastards took away even that. Dragon leapt suddenly, bat wings unfolding. Vimes' wooden bolt clattered somewhere near the ceiling as he was borne down. You really thought you could arrest me with a piece of wood, said Dragon, his hand around Vimes's neck. No, Vimes croaked. I was more poetic than that. All I had to do was keep you talking. Feeling weak, are you? The bitter bit, you might say, he grinned. The vampire looked puzzled and then turned his head and stared at the candles. You put something in the candles? Really? We knew garlic would smell, but our alchemists reckoned that if you get holy water, soak the wicks, water evaporates, <laughs> just leaves holiness. The pressure was released. Dragon King of Arms sat back on his haunches. His face had changed, shaping itself forward, giving him an expression like a fox. Then he shook his head. No, he said, and this time it was his turn to grin. No, that's just words. That wouldn't work. Bet your unlife, rasped Vimes, rubbing his neck, a better way than old Carrie went, eh? Trying to trick me into an admission, Mr. Vimes? Oh, I had that, said Vimes, when you looked straight at the candles. Really? <laughs> but who else saw me? said Dragon. From the shadows. There was a rumble like a distant thunderstorm. I did, said Dorfel. The vampire looked from the golem to Vimes. You gave one of them a voice, he said. Yes, said Dorfel. He reached down and picked up the vampire in one hand. I could kill you, he said. This is an option available to me. 
as a free-thinking individual, but I will not do so, because I own myself, and I have made a moral choice. Oh, gods, murmured Vimes under his breath. That's blasphemy, said the vampire. He gasped as Vimes shot him a glance like sunlight. That's what people say when the voiceless speak. Take him away, Dorval, put him in the palace dungeons. I could take no notice of that command, but am choosing to do so out of earned respect and social responsibility. Yes, yes, fine, said Vimes quickly. Dragon clawed at the golem. He might as well have kicked at a mountain. Undead or alive, you are coming with me, said Dorful. Is there no end to your crimes? You've made this thing a policeman, said the vampire, struggling as Dorful dragged him away. No, but it's an intriguing suggestion, don't you think, said Vimes. He was left alone in the thick, velvety gloom of the Royal College. And Vetinari will let him go, he reflected, because this is politics, because he's part of the way the city works. Besides, there's the matter of evidence. I've got enough to prove it to myself, but... But I'll know, he told himself. Oh, he'll be watched, and maybe one day when Vetinari is ready, a really good assassin will be sent with a wooden dagger soaked in garlic, and it'll all be done in the dark. That's how politics works in this city. It's a game of chess. Who cares if a few pawns die? I'll know, and I'll be the only one who knows deep down. His hands automatically patted his pockets for a cigar. It was hard enough to kill a vampire. You could stake them down and turn them into dust, and ten years later someone spills a drop of blood in the wrong place, and guess who's back? They returned more times than raw broccoli. These were dangerous thoughts, he knew. They were the kind that crept up on a watchman when the chase was over and it was just you and him facing one another in that breathless little pinch between the crime and the punishment. And maybe a watchman had seen civilization with the skin ripped off one time too many and stopped acting like a watchman and started acting like a normal human being and realized that the click of the crossbow or the sweep of the sword would make all the world so clean. And you couldn't think like that, even about vampires. Even though they'd take the lives of other people because little lives don't matter, and what the hell can we take away from them? And you couldn't think like that because they gave you a sword and a badge, and that turned you into something else. And that had to mean there were some thoughts you couldn't think. Only crimes could take place in darkness. Punishment had to be done in the light. That was the job of a good watchman, Carrot always said, to light a candle in the dark. He found a cigar. Now his hands did the automatic search for matches. The volumes were piled up against the walls. The candlelight picked up gold lettering and the dull gleam of leather. There they were, the lineages, the books of heraldic minutiae, the who's whom of the centuries, the stock books of the city. People stood on them to look down. No matches. Quietly, in the dusty silence of the college, Vimes picked up a candelabrum and lit his cigar. He took a few deep, luxuriant puffs, and looked thoughtfully at the books. In his hand, the candles spluttered and flickered. The clock ticked its arrhythmic tock. It finally stuttered its way to one o'clock, and Vimes got up and went into the oblong office. Ah, Vimes, said Lord Vetinari, looking up. Yes, sir. Vimes had managed a few hours' sleep and had even attempted to shave. The patrician shuffled some papers on his desk. It seems to have been a very busy night last night. Yes, sir. Vimes stood to attention. All uniformed men knew in their very soul how to act in circumstances like this. You stared straight ahead, for one thing. It appears that I have Dragon King of Arms in the cells, said the patrician. Yes, sir. I've read your report. Somewhat tenuous evidence, I feel. Sir, one of your witnesses isn't even alive, Vimes. No, sir. Neither is the suspect, sir. Technically. He is, however, an important civic figure. An authority. Yes, sir. 
Lord Vetinari shuffled some of the papers on his desk. One of them was covered in sooty finger marks. It also appears... I have to commend you, Commander. Sir, the heralds at the Royal College of Arms, or at least at what remains of the Royal College of Arms, have sent me a note saying how bravely you worked last night. Sir, letting all those heraldic animals out of the pens and raising the alarm and so on. A tower of strength, they've called you. I gather most of the creatures are lodging with you at the present time? Yes, sir. Couldn't stand by and let them suffer, sir. We've got some empty pens, sir, and Keith and Roderick are doing well in the lake. They've taken a liking to Sybil, sir. Lord Vetinari coughed. Then he stared up at the ceiling for a while. So you, um, hmm, assisted in the fire? Yes, sir. Civic duty, sir. The fire was caused by a candlestick falling over, I understand. Possibly after your fight with Dragon King of Arms. So I believe, sir. And so it seems do the heralds. Anyone told Dragon King of Arms, said Vimes innocently. Yes. Took it well, did he? He screamed a lot, Vimes. In a heart-rending fashion, I am told, and I gather he uttered a number of threats against you, for some reason. I shall try to fit him into my busy schedule, sir. Ingly-bungly beep, said a small bright voice. Vimes slapped a hand against his pocket. Lord Vetinari fell silent for a moment. His fingers drummed softly on his desk. Many fine old manuscripts in that place, I believe. Without price, I'm told. Yes, sir. Certainly worthless, sir. Is it possible you misunderstood what I just said, Commander? Could be, sir. The provenances of many splendid old families went up in smoke, Commander. Of course, the heralds will do what they can, and the families themselves keep records, but frankly, I understand it's all going to be patchwork and guesswork. Extremely embarrassing. Are you smiling, Commander? It was probably a trick of the light, sir. Commander, I always used to consider that you had a definite anti-authoritarian streak in you. Sir, it seems that you have managed to retain this even though you are authority. Sir, that's practically Zen. Sir, it seems I've only got to be unwell for a few days, and you managed to upset everyone of any importance in this city. Sir? Was that a yes, sir, or a no, sir, Sir Samuel? It was just a sir, sir. Lord Vetinari glanced at a piece of paper. Did you really punch the president of the Assassin's Guild? Yes, sir. Why? Didn't have a dagger, sir. Vetinari turned away abruptly. The Council of Churches, Temples, Sacred Groves, and Big Ominous Rocks is demanding, uh, well, a number of things, several of them involving wild horses. Initially, however, they want me to sack you. Yes, sir. In all, I've had seventeen demands for your badge. Some want parts of your body attached. Why did you have to upset everybody? I suppose it's a knack, sir. But what could you hope to achieve? Well, sir, since you ask, we found out who murdered Father Tubalcheck and Mr. Hopkinson, and who was poisoning you, sir. Vimes paused. Two out of three is not bad, sir. Vetinari riffled through the papers again. Workshop owners, assassins, priests, butchers. Hmm, you seem to have infuriated most of the leading figures in the city, he sighed. Really, it seems I have no choice. As of this week, I'm giving you a pay rise. Vimes blinked. Sir? Nothing unseemly. Mm, Ten dollars a month. And I expect they need a new dartboard in the watch house. They usually do, I recall. It's detritus, said Vimes, his mind unable to think of anything other than an honest reply. He tends to split them. Ah, yes. And talking of splits, Vimes, I wonder if your forensic genius could help me with a little conundrum we found this morning. The patrician stood up and headed for the stairs. Yes, sir, what is it? said Vimes, following him down. It's in the rat's chamber, Vimes. Really, sir? Vetinari pushed open the double doors. Voila, he said. That's some kind of musical instrument, isn't it, sir? 
No, Commander, the word means, What is that in the table? said the patrician sharply. Vimes looked into the room. There was no one there. The long mahogany table was bare, except for the axe. It had embedded itself in the wood very deeply, almost splitting the table along its entire length. Someone had walked up to the table and brought an axe down right in the centre as hard as they could, and then left it there, its handle pointing towards the ceiling. That's an axe, said Vimes. Astonishing, said Lord Vetinari, and you barely had time to study it. Mm. Why is it there? I really couldn't say, sir. According to the servants, Sir Samuel, you came into the palace at six o'clock this morning. Oh, yes, sir, to check that the bastard was safely in a cell, sir, and to see that everything was all right, of course. You didn't come into this room? Vimes kept his gaze fixed somewhere on the horizon. Why should I have done that, sir? The patrician tapped the axe handle. It vibrated with a faint thumping noise. I believe some of the city council met in here this morning, or came in here at least. I'm told they hurried out very quickly, looking rather disturbed, I'm told. Maybe it was one of them that did it, sir. That is, of course, a possibility, said Lord Vetinari. I suppose you wouldn't be able to find one of your famous clues on the thing? Shouldn't think so, sir. Not with all these fingerprints on it. It would be a terrible thing, would it not, if people thought that they could take the law into their own hands? Oh, no fear of that, sir. I'm holding on tightly to it. Lord Vetinari plunked the axe again. Tell me, Sir Samuel, do you know the phrase quis custodiet ipsos custodes? It was an expression Carrot had occasionally used, but Vimes was not in the mood to admit anything. Carl said that I do, sir, he said. Something about trifle, is it? It means who guards the guards themselves, Sir Samuel. Ah, well, sir... Who watches the watch, I wonder? Oh, that's easy, sir. We watch one another. Really? Mm, an intriguing point. Lord Vetinari walked out of the room and back into the main hall with Vimes trailing behind. However, he said, in order to keep the peace, the golem will have to be destroyed. Now, sir, allow me... To repeat my instruction. No, sir. I'm sure I just gave you an order, Commander. I distinctly felt my lips move. No, sir. He's alive, sir. He's just made of clay, Vimes. Aren't we all, sir? According to them pamphlets, Constable Visit keeps handing out. Anyway, he thinks he's alive, and that's good enough for me. The patrician waved a hand towards the stairs and his office full of paper. Nevertheless, Commander, I've had no less than nine missives from leading religious figures declaring that he is an abomination. Yes, sir. I've given that viewpoint a lot of thought, sir, and reached the following conclusion. Arseholes to the lot of them, sir. The patrician's hand covered his mouth for a moment. Mm, sir Samuel, you are a harsh negotiator. Surely you can give and take? Couldn't say, sir. Vimes walked to the main doors and pushed them open. Fog's lifted, sir, he said. There's a bit of cloud, but you can see all the way across the brass bridge. What will you use the golem for? Not use, sir. Employ. I thought it might be useful to keep the peace, sir. Mm, a watchman. Yes, sir, said Vimes. Haven't you heard, sir? Golems do all the mucky jobs. Vetinari watched him go and sighed. <sighs> he does so like a dramatic exit, he said. Yes, my lord, said Drumnot, who had appeared noiselessly at his shoulder. Ah, Drumnot, the patrician took a length of candle out of his pocket and handed it to his secretary. Dispose of this somewhere safely, will you? Yes, my lord. It's the candle from the other night. It's not burnt down, my lord, but I, 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 I saw the candle end in the holder. 
Oh, of course. I cut off enough to make a stub and let the wick burn for a moment. I couldn't let our gallant policeman know I'd worked it out for myself, could I? Not when he was making such an effort and having so much fun being, well, being rhymes. I'm not completely heartless, you know. But, m my, my lord, you could have sorted it out diplomatically. Instead, he went around upsetting things and making a lot of people very angry and, and afraid. Yes. Mm, dear me. Ah, said Drumnot. Quite so, said the patrician. Do you wish me to have the table in the rat's chamber repaired? No, Drumnot. Leave the axe where it is. It will make a good conversation piece, I think. May I make an observation, my lord? Of course you may, said Vetinari, watching Vimes walk through the palace gates. The thought occurs, sir, uh, th th that if Commander Vimes did not exist, you would have had to invent him. You know, Drumnot, I rather think I did. Atheism is also a religious position, Dorful rumbled. No, it's not, said Constable Visit. Atheism is a denial of a god. Therefore it is a religious position, said Dorful. Indeed, a true atheist thinks of the gods constantly, albeit in terms of denial. Therefore atheism is a form of belief. If the atheist truly did not believe, he or she would not bother to deny. Did you read those pamphlets I gave you? said Visit suspiciously. Yes, many of them did not make sense, but I should like to read some more. Really? said Visit, his eyes gleamed. You really want more pamphlets? Yes, there is much in them that I would like to discuss. If you know some priests, I would enjoy disputation. All right, all right, said Sergeant Colon. So are you going to take the sodding oath or not, Dorful? Dorful held up a hand the size of a shovel. I, Dorful, pending the discovery of a deity whose existence withstands rational debate, swear by the temporary precepts of a self-derived moral system. You really want more pamphlets, said Constable Visit. Sergeant Colon rolled his eyes. Yes, said Dorful. Oh, my God, said Constable Visit, and burst into tears. No one's ever asked for more pamphlets before. Colon turned when he realized Vimes was watching. It's no good, sir, he said. I've been trying to swear him in for half an hour, sir, and we keep ending up arguing about oaths and things. You willing to be a watchman, Dorful? said Vimes. Yes. Right. That's as good as I swear to be. Give him his badge, Fred, and this is for you, Dorful. It's a chit to say you're officially alive, just in case you run into any trouble. You know, with people. Thank you, said Dorful solemnly. If ever I feel I am not alive, I will take this out and read it. What are your duties, said Vimes, to serve the public trust... Protect the innocent and seriously prod buttock, sir, said Dorful. He learns fast, doesn't he, said Colon. I didn't even tell him the last one. People won't like it, said Nobby. It's not going to be popular. A golem as a watchman. What better work for one who loves freedom than the job of watchman? Law is the servant of freedom. Freedom without limits is just a word, said Dorful ponderously. You know, said Colin, if it doesn't work out, you could always get a job making fortune cookies. Funny thing, that, said Nobby. You never get bad fortunes in cookies. Ever notice that? They never say stuff like, oh dear, things are going to be really bad. I mean, they never miss fortune cookies. Vimes lit a cigar and shook the match to put it out. That, Corporal, is because of one of the fundamental driving forces of the universe. What, like people who read fortune cookies are the lucky ones, said Nobby. No, 
because people who sell fortune cookies want to go on selling them. Come on, Constable Dorful, we're going for a walk. There's a lot of paperwork, sir, said Sergeant Colon. Tell Captain Carrot I said he should look at it, said Vimes from the doorway. He hasn't been in yet, sir. It'll keep. Right, sir. Colon went and sat behind his desk. It was a good place to be, he decided. There was absolutely no chance of finding any nature there. He'd had a rare conversation with Mrs. Colon this morning, and made it clear that he was no longer interested in getting close to the soil, because he'd been as close to the soil as it was possible to get, and the soil, it turned out, was just dirt. A good thick layer of cobblestones was, he decided, about as close as he wanted to get to nature. Also, nature tended to be squishy. I've got to go on duty, said Nobby. Captain Carrot wants me to do crime prevention in Peach Pie Street. How'd you do that, then? said Colon. Keep away, he said. You, Nobby, what's this about you not being a lord after all? said Colon cautiously. I think I got the sack, said Nobby. Bit of a relief, really. That Nobby grub isn't much, and the drink is frankly piss. Lucky escape for you, then, said Colon. I mean, you won't have to go giving your toes away to gardeners and so on. Yeah, wish I'd never told them about the damn ring, really. Would have saved you a lot of trouble, certainly, said Colin. Nobby spat on his badge and buffed it industriously with his sleeve. It's a good job I never told him about the tiara, the coronet and the three gold lockets, he said to himself. Where are we going? said Dorful, as Vimes strolled across the brass bridge. I thought I might break you in gently with some guard duty at the palace, said Vimes. Ah, this is where my new friend Constable Visit is also on guard, said Dorful. Splendid. I wish to ask you a question, said the golem. Yes? I smashed the treadmill, but the golems repaired it. Why? And I let the animals go, but they just milled around stupidly. Some of them even went back to the slaughter pens. Why? Welcome to the world, Constable Dorful. Is it frightening to be free? You said it. And say to people, throw off your chains and they make new chains for themselves? Seems to be a major human activity, yes. Dorful rumbled as he thought about this. Yes, he said eventually, I can see why. Freedom is like having the top of your head opened up. I'll have to take your word for that, Constable. And you will pay me twice as much as other watchmen, said Dorful. Will I? Yes. I do not sleep. I can work constantly. I am a bargain. I do not need days off to bury my granny. How soon they learn, thought Vimes. He said, but you have holy days off, don't you? Either all days are holy or none are. I have not decided yet. Er, uh, what do you need money for, Dorful? I shall save up and purchase the golem Klutz, who labours in the pickle factory, and give him to himself. Then together we will earn and save for the golem Bobkiss of the coal merchant. The three of us will labour and buy the golem Schmata, who toils at the Seven Dollar Tailors in Peach Pie Street. Then the four of us will... Some people might decide to free their comrades by force and bloody revolution, said Vimes. Not that I'm suggesting that in any way, of course. No, that would be theft. We are bought and sold, so we will buy ourselves free by our labor. No one else to do it for us. We will do it by ourselves. Vimes smiled to himself. Probably no other species in the world would demand a receipt with their freedom. Some things you just couldn't change. Ah, he said, it seems some people want to talk to us. A crowd was approaching over the bridge in a mass of grey, black and saffron robes. It was made up of priests. They looked angry. As they pushed and shoved their way through the other citizens, several halos became interlocked. At their head was Hunon Ridcully, chief priest of Blind Eo, and the closest thing Ankh Morpork had to a spokesman on religious issues. He spotted Vimes and hurried towards him, admonitory finger upraised. Now see here, Vimes, he began, and stopped. 
He glared at Dorful. Is this it? he said. If you mean the golem, this is him, said Vimes. Constable Dorful, your reverence. Dorful touched his helmet, respectively. How may we be of service? he said. You've done it this time, Vimes, said Ridcully, ignoring him. You've gone altogether too far by half. You made this thing speak, and it isn't even alive. We want it smashed. Blasphemy! People won't stand for it. Ridcully looked around at the other priests. I'm talking, he said. He turned back to Vimes. This comes under the heading of gross profanity and the worship of idols. I don't worship him. I'm just employing him, said Vimes, beginning to enjoy himself. And he's far from idle. He took a deep breath. And if it's gross profanity you're looking for... Excuse me, said Dorful. We're not listening to you. You're not even really alive, said a priest. Dorful nodded. This is fundamentally true, he said. See, he admits it. I suggest you take me and smash me and grind the bits into fragments and pound the fragments into powder and mill them again to the finest dust there can be, and I believe you will not find a single atom of life. True, let's do it. However, in order to test this fully, one of you must volunteer to undergo the same process. There was a silence. That's not fair, said a priest after a while. All anyone has to do is bake up your dust again and you'd be alive. There was more silence. Ridcully said, Is it only me or are we on tricky theological ground here? There was more silence. Another priest said, Is it true you've said you'll believe in any god whose existence can be proved by logical debate? Yes. Vimes had a feeling about the immediate future and took a few steps away from Dorful. But the gods plainly do exist, said a priest. It is not evident. A bolt of lightning lanced through the clouds and hit Dorful's helmet. There was a sheet of flame and then a trickling noise. Dorful's molten armor formed puddles around his white-hot feet. I don't call that much of an argument, said Dorful calmly from somewhere in the clouds of smoke. It's tended to carry the audience, said Vimes, up till now. The chief priest of Blind Yeo turned to the other priests. All right, you fellows, there's no need for any of that. But Offler is a vengeful god, said a priest at the back of the crowd. Trigger happy is what he is, said Ridcully. Another lightning bolt zigzagged down, but bent at right angles a few feet above the chief priest's hat, and earthed itself on a wooden hippo, which split. The chief priest smiled smugly and turned back to Dorful, who was making little clinking noises as he cooled. What you're saying is, you'll accept the existence of any god only if it can be proved by discussion. Yes, said Dorful. Ridcully rubbed his hands together. Not a problem, me old China, he said. Firstly, let us take the— Excuse me, said Dorful. He bent down and picked up his badge. The lightning had given it an interesting melted shape. What are you doing? said Ridcully. Somewhere a crime is happening, said Dorful, but when I am off duty, I will gladly dispute with the priest of the most worthy god. He turned and strode on across the bridge. Vimes nodded hurriedly at the shocked priests and ran after him. We took him and baked him in the fire, and he's turned out to be free, he thought. No words in the head except the ones he's chosen to put there himself, and he's not just an atheist, he's a ceramic atheist, fireproof. It looked like being a good day. Behind them on the bridge, a fight was breaking out. Angua was packing, or rather she was failing to pack. The bundle couldn't be too heavy to carry by mouth. But a little money, she wouldn't have to buy much food, and a change of clothes, for those occasions when she might have to wear clothes, didn't have to take up much room. The boots are a problem, she said aloud. Maybe if you knot the laces together, you could carry them round your neck, said Cherie, who was sitting on the narrow bed. Good idea. Do you want these dresses? I've never got round to wearing them. I expect you could cut them down. Cherie took them in both arms. This one's silk. There's probably enough material for you to make two for one. Do you mind if I share them out? Only some of the lads, the, the ladies at the watch house, Cherie savoured the word ladies, are beginning to get a bit thoughtful. 
Going to melt down their helmets, are they? said Angua. Oh, no, but perhaps they could be made into a more attractive design. Um, yes? Um, Cherie shifted uneasily. You've never actually eaten anyone, have you? You know, crunching bones and so on? No. I mean, I only heard my second cousin was eaten by werewolves. He was called Sven. Can't say I recall the name, said Angua. Cherie tried to grin. That's all right, then, she said. So you won't need that silver spoon in your pocket, said Angua. Cherie's mouth dropped open, and then the words tumbled over themselves. Uh, I, I, I don't know how it got there. Must have dropped in when I was, um, washing up. I, I didn't mean... It doesn't worry me, honestly. I'm used to it. But I didn't think you'd... Look, don't get the wrong idea. It's not a case of not wanting to, said Angua. It's a case of wanting to and not doing it. You don't really have to go, do you? Oh, I don't know if I can take the watch seriously, and sometimes I think Carrot's working up to ask me... Well, it'd never work out. It's the way he just assumes everything, you know. So it's best to go now, Angua lied. Won't Carrot try and stop you? Yes, but there's nothing he can say. He'll be upset. Yes, said Angua briskly, throwing another dress on the bed, and then he'll get over it. Rolf Thighbite has asked me out, said Cherie shyly, looking at the floor, and I'm almost certain he's male. Glad to hear it. Cherie stood up. I'll walk with you as far as the watch house. I've got to go on duty. They were halfway along Elm Street before they saw Carrot, head and shoulders above the crowd. Looks like he was coming to see you, said Cherie. Um, shall I go away? Too late. Ah, oh, good morning, Corporal Miss Littlebottom, said Carrot cheerfully. Hello, Angua. I was just coming to see you, but I had to write my letter home first, of course. He took off his helmet and smoothed back his hair. Ah, uh, he began. I know what you're going to ask, said Angua. You do? I know you've been thinking about it. You knew I was wondering about going. It was obvious, was it? And the answer's no. I wish it could be yes. Carrot looked astonished. It never occurred to me that you'd say no, he said. I mean, why should you? Good grief, you amaze me, she said. You really do. I thought it would be something you'd want to do, said Carrot. He sighed. Oh, well, doesn't matter, really. Angua felt that a leg had been kicked away. It doesn't matter, she said. I mean, yes, it'd have been nice, but I won't lose any sleep over it. You won't? Well, no, obviously not. You've got other things you want to do. That's fine. I just thought you might enjoy it. I'll do it by myself. What? How can... Angua stopped. What are you talking about, Carrot? The Dwarf Bread Museum. I promised Mr. Hopkinson's sister that I'd tidy it up. You know, get it sorted out. She's not very well off, and I thought it could raise some money. Just between you and me, there's several exhibits in there that could be better presented. <laughs> but I'm afraid Mr. Hopkinson was rather set in his ways. I'm sure there's a lot of dwarfs in the city that would flock there if they knew about it. And, of course, there's a lot of youngsters that ought to learn more about their proud heritage. A good dusting and a lick of paint would make all the difference, I'm sure, especially on the older loaves. I don't mind giving up a few days off. I just thought it might cheer you up. But I appreciate that bread isn't everyone's cup of tea. Angua stared at him. It was the stare that Carrot so often attracted. It roamed every feature of his face, looking for the tiniest clue that he was making some kind of a joke. Some long, deep joke at the expense of everyone else. Every sinew in her body knew that he must be, but there was not a clue, not a twitch to prove it. Yes, she said weakly, still searching his face. I expect it could be a little gold mine. Museums have got to be a whole lot more interesting these days, and you know there's a whole gorilla crumpet assortment he hasn't even catalogued, said Carrot, and some early examples of defensive bagels. Gosh, said Angua, hey, why don't we paint a big sign saying something like, The Dwarf Bread Experience? Uh, that probably wouldn't work for dwarfs, said Carrot, oblivious to sarcasm. A Dwarf Bread Experience tends to be short but I can see it certainly caught your imagination. I'll have to go, Angua thought as they strolled on down the street. Sooner or later, he'll see that it can't really work out, werewolves and humans. We've both got too much to lose. Sooner or later, I'll have to leave him. But, 
for one day at a time. Let it be tomorrow. Want the dresses back? Said Cherie behind her. Maybe one or two, said Angua. That is the end of Feet of Clay. It was written by Terry Pratchett and read by Nigel Clayner. Isis Audiobooks presents an unabridged recording of Hogfather, written by Terry Pratchett, read by Nigel Clayner. Everything starts somewhere, although many physicists disagree. But people have always been dimly aware of the problem with the start of things. They wonder aloud how the snowplow driver gets to work, or how the makers of dictionaries look up the spelling of words. Yet there is the constant desire to find some point in the twisting, knotting, ravelling nets of space-time on which a metaphorical finger can be put to indicate that here, here, is the point where it all began. Something began when the Guild of Assassins enrolled Mr. Tea Time, who saw things differently from other people, and one of the ways that he saw things differently from other people was in seeing other people as things. Later, Lord Downey of the Guild said, "We took pity on him because he'd lost both parents at an early age. I think that on reflection, we should have wondered a bit more about that." But it was much earlier, even than that, when most people forgot that the very oldest stories are sooner or later about blood. Later on, they took the blood out to make the stories more acceptable to children, or at least to the people who had to read them to children rather than the children themselves, who, on the whole, are quite keen on blood, provided it's being shed by the deserving, that is to say, those who deserve to shed blood, or possibly not. You never quite know with some kids, and then wondered where the stories went. And earlier still, when something in the darkness of the deepest caves and gloomiest forests thought, "What are they, these creatures? I will observe them." And much, much earlier than that, when the disc world was formed, drifting onwards through space, atop four elephants on the shell of the giant turtle, Great Atuin. Possibly, as it moves. It gets tangled like a blind man in a cobwebbed house in those highly specialised little space-time strands that try to breed in every history they encounter, stretching them and breaking them and tugging them into new shapes, or possibly not, of course. The philosopher Didactylos has summed up an alternative hypothesis as things just happen. What the hell? The senior wizards of Unseen University stood and looked at the door. There was no doubt that whoever had shut it wanted it to stay shut. Dozens of nails secured it to the door frame. Planks had been nailed right across, and finally it had, up until this morning, been hidden by a bookcase that had been put in front of it. And there's the sign, Ridcully," said the dean. "You have read it, I assume. You know, 
A sign which says, Do not under any circumstances open this door. Of, of course I've read it, said Ridcully. Why do you think I want it opened? Um, why, said the lecturer in recent runes, to see why they wanted it shut, of course. This exchange contains almost all you need to know about human civilization, at least those bits of it that are now under the sea, fenced off or still smoking. He gestured to Modo, the university's gardener and odd job dwarf, who was standing by with a crowbar. Go to it, lad! The gardener saluted. Right you are, sir. Against a background of splintering timber, Ridcully went on, It says on the plans that this was a, a, a bathroom. There's nothing frightening about a bathroom, for God's sake. I want a bathroom. I'm fed up with sluicing down with you fellows. It's unhygienic. You can catch stuff. My father told me that. Where you get lots of people bathing together, the Veruca gnome is running around with his little sack. Is that like the tooth fairy? said the dean sarcastically. I'm in charge here, and I want a bathroom of my own, said Ridcully firmly. And that's all there is to it, all right? I want a bathroom in time for Hog's Watch Night. Understand? And that's a problem with beginnings, of course. Sometimes when you're dealing with occult realms that have quite a different attitude to time, you get the effect a little way before the cause. From somewhere on the edge of hearing came a glinga linga 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 noise, like little silver bells. At about the same time as the Arch-Chancellor was laying down the law, Susan Stowe Hellet was sitting up in bed, reading by candlelight. Frost patterns curled across the windows. She enjoyed these early evenings. Once she'd put the children to bed, she was more or less left to herself. Mrs. Gator was pathetically scared of giving her any instructions, even though she paid Susan's wages. Not that the wages were important, of course. What was important was that she was being her own person and holding down a real job. And being a governess was a real job. The only tricky bit had been the embarrassment when her employer found out that she was a duchess, because in Mrs. Gator's book, which was rather a short book with big handwriting, the upper crust wasn't supposed to work. It was supposed to loaf around. It was all Susan could do to stop her curtsying when they met. A flicker made her turn her head. The candle flame was streaming out horizontally as though in a howling wind. She looked up. The curtains billowed away from the window, which flung itself open with a clatter. But there was no wind. At least, no wind in this world. Images formed in her mind. A red ball. The sharp smell of snow. And then they were gone. And instead there were... Teeth, said Susan aloud. Teeth? Again? She blinked. When she opened her eyes, the window was, as she knew it would be, firmly shut. The curtain hung demurely. The candle flame was innocently upright. Oh, no, not again. Not after all this time. Everything had been going so well. Susan? She looked around. Her door had been pushed open, and a small figure stood there barefoot in a nightdress. She sighed. Yes, Twyla? I'm afraid of the monster in the cellar, Susan. It's going to eat me up. Susan shut her book firmly and raised a warning finger. What have I told you about trying to sound ingratiatingly cute, Twyla? She said. The little girl said, You said I mustn't. You said that exaggerated lisping is a hanging offence and I only do it to get attention. Good. Do you know what monster it is this time? It's the big hairy one with... Susan raised the finger. Hmm? She warned. With eight arms, Twyla corrected herself. What, again? Oh, all right. She got out of bed and put on her dressing gown, trying to stay quite calm while the child watched her. So they were coming back. Oh, not the monster in the cellar. That was all in a day's work. But it looked as if she was going to start remembering the future again. She shook her head. However far you ran away, you always caught yourself up. But monsters were easy, at least. She'd learned how to deal with monsters. She picked up the poker from the nursery fender and went down the back stairs with Twyla following her. The gators were having a dinner party. Muffled voices came from the direction of the dining room. Then, as she crept past, a door opened, and yellow light spilled out, and a voice said, "'Ye gods, there's a girl in a nightshirt out here with a poker!' She saw figures silhouetted in the light and made out the worried face of Mrs. Gator. 
Susan, um, what are you doing? Susan looked at the poker and then back at the woman. Twyla said she's afraid of a monster in the cellar, Mrs. Gator. And you're going to attack it with a poker, eh? said one of the guests. There was a strong atmosphere of brandy and cigars. Yes, said Susan, simply. Susan's how a governess, said Mrs. Gator. Her, I told you about her. There was a change in the expression on the faces peering out from the dining room. It became a sort of amused respect. She beats up monsters with a poker, said someone. Actually, that's a very clever idea, said someone else. Little girl gets it into her head there's a monster in the cellar. You go in with a poker and make a few bashing noises while the child listens, and then everything's all right. Good thinking, that girl. Very sensible. Very modern. Is that what you're doing, Susan? said Mrs. Gator anxiously. Yes, Mrs. Gator, said Susan obediently. This I've got to watch by Eo. It's not every day you see monsters beaten up by a girl, said the man behind her. There was a swish of silk and a cloud of cigar smoke as the diners poured out into the hall. Susan sighed again and went down the cellar stairs while Twyla sat demurely at the top, hugging her knees. A door opened and shut. There was a short period of silence and then a terrifying scream. One woman fainted and a man dropped his cigar. You don't have to worry. Everything will be all right, said Twyla calmly. She always wins. Everything will be all right. There were thuds and clangs, then a whirring noise, and finally a sort of bubbling. Susan pushed open the door. The poker was bent at right angles. There was nervous applause. Very well done, said a guest. Very psychological. Clever idea that bend in the poker. And I expect you're not afraid any more, eh, little girl? No, said Twyla. Very psychological. Susan says, "Don't get afraid, get angry," said Twyla. Thank you, Susan," said Mrs. Gator, now a trembling bouquet of nerves. "And her now, Sir Jeffrey, if you'd all like to come back into the parlour—I I mean the drawing room." The party went back up the hall. The last thing Susan heard before the door shut was dash convincing the way she bent the poker like that. She waited. Have they all gone, Twyla? Yes, Susan. Good. Susan went back into the cellar and emerged, towing something large and hairy with eight legs. She managed to haul it up the steps and down the other passage to the back yard, where she kicked it out. It would evaporate before dawn. That's what we do to monsters, she said. Twyla watched carefully. And now it's bed for you, my girl," said Susan, picking her up. "Can I have the poker in my room for the night?" All right. It only kills monsters, doesn't it? The child said sleepily as Susan carried her upstairs. That's right," said Susan. "All kinds." She put the girl to bed next to her brother and leaned the poker against the toy cupboard. The poker was made of some cheap metal with a brass knob on the end. She would, Susan reflected, give quite a lot to be able to use it on the children's previous governess. Good night. Good night. She went back to her own small bedroom and got back into bed, watching the curtains suspiciously. It would be nice to think she'd imagined it. It would also be stupid to think that too. But she'd been nearly normal for two years now, making her own way in the real world, never remembering the future at all. Perhaps she had just dreamed things, but even dreams could be real. She tried to ignore the long thread of wax that suggested the candle had just for a few seconds. Streamed in the wind. As Susan sought sleep, Lord Downey sat in his study, catching up on the paperwork. Lord Downey was an assassin, or rather, an assassin. The capital letter was important. It separated those curs who went around murdering people for money from the gentlemen who were occasionally consulted by other gentlemen who wished to have removed, for a consideration, any inconvenient razor blades from the candy floss of life. The members of the guild of assassins considered themselves cultured men who enjoyed good music and food and literature, and they knew the value of human life, to a penny in many cases. Lord Downey's study was oak panelled and well carpeted. The furniture was very old and quite worn, but the wear was the wear that comes only when very good furniture is carefully used over several centuries. It was matured furniture. A log fire burned in the grate. 
In front of it, a couple of dogs were sleeping in the tangled way of large hairy dogs everywhere. Apart from the occasional doggy snore, or the crackle of a shifting log, there were no other sounds but the scratching of Lord Downey's pen and the ticking of the long case clock by the door. Small, private noises which only served to define the silence. At least this was the case until someone cleared their throat. The sound suggested very clearly that the purpose of the exercise was not to erase the presence of a troublesome bit of biscuit, but merely to indicate in the politest way possible the presence of the throat. Downey stopped writing, but did not raise his head. Then, after what appeared to be some consideration, he said in a businesslike voice, "'The doors are locked. The windows are barred. The dogs do not appear to have woken up. The squeaky floorboards haven't. Other little arrangements which I will not specify seem to have been bypassed. That severely limits the possibilities. I really doubt that you are a ghost, and gods generally do not announce themselves so politely. You could, of course, be deaf, but I don't believe he bothers with such niceties, and besides, I am feeling quite well. Hmm. Something hovered in the air in front of his desk. My teeth are in fine condition, so you are unlikely to be the tooth fairy. I've always found that a stiff brandy before bedtime quite does away with the need for the sandman, and since I can carry a tune quite well, I suspect I'm not likely to attract the attention of old man trouble. Hmm. The figure drifted a little nearer. I suppose a gnome could get through a mouse hole, but I have traps down, Downey went on. Bogeymen can walk through walls, but would be very loath to reveal themselves. Really, you have me at a loss, hmm? And then he looked up. A grey robe hung in the air. It appeared to be occupied, in that it had a shape, although the occupant was not visible. The prickly feeling crept over Downey that the occupant wasn't invisible, merely not in any physical sense, there at all. Good evening, he said. The robe said, Good evening, Lord Downey. His brain registered the words. His ears swore they hadn't heard them. But you did not become head of the Assassin's Guild by taking fright easily. Besides, the thing wasn't frightening. It was, thought Downey, astonishingly dull. If monotonous drabness could take on a shape, this would be the shape it would choose. You appear to be... A spectre, he said. Our nature is not a matter for discussion, arrived in his head. We offer you a commission. Ah, you wish someone inhumed, said Downey. Brought to an end. Downey considered this. It was not as unusual as it appeared. There were precedents. Anyone could buy the services of the guild. Several zombies had in the past employed the guild to settle scores with their murderers. In fact, the guild, he liked to think, practised the ultimate democracy. You didn't need intelligence, social position, beauty or charm to hire it. You just needed money, which, unlike the other stuff, was available to everyone. Except for the poor, of course. But there was no helping some people. Brought to an end. That was an odd way of putting it. We can, he began. The payment will reflect the difficulty of the task. Our scale of fees is... The payment will be three million dollars. Downey sat back. That was four times higher than any fee yet earned by any member of the Guild, and that had been a special family rate, including overnight guests. No questions asked, I assume, he said, buying time. No questions answered. But does the suggested fee represent the difficulty involved? The client is heavily guarded? Not guarded at all, but almost certainly impossible to delete with conventional weapons. Downey nodded. This was not necessarily a big problem, he said to himself. The Guild had amassed quite a few unconventional weapons over the years. Delete, an unusual way of putting it. We like to know for whom we are working, he said. We are sure you do. I mean that we need to know your name, or names, 
In strict client confidentiality, of course. We have to write something down in our files. You may think of us as the auditors. Really? Uh, what is it you audit? Everything. I think we need to know something about you. We are the people with three million dollars. Downey took the point, although he didn't like it. Three million dollars could buy a lot of no questions. Really, he said, in the circumstances, since you are a new client, I think we would like um, payment in advance. As you wish. The gold is now in your vaults. You mean that it will shortly be in our vaults, said Downey. No. It has always been in your vaults. We know this because we have just put it there. Downey watched the empty hood for a moment, and then, without shifting his gaze, he reached out and picked up the speaking tube. Uh, Mr. Winrow, he said, after whistling into it. Ah, good. Tell me, how much do we have in our vaults at the moment? Uh, ap approximately. Um, to the nearest million, say. He held the tube away from his ear for a moment and then spoke into it again. Well, be a good chap and check anyway, will you? He hung up the tube and placed his hands flat on the desk in front of him. Mm. Can I offer you a drink while we wait? he said. Yes, we believe so. Downey stood up with some relief and walked over to his large drinks cabinet. His hand hovered over the guild's ancient and valuable tantalus, with its labelled decanters of myrrh, nidge, Trop and Iskubl. It's a sad and terrible thing that high-born folk really have thought that the servants would be totally fooled if spirits were put into decanters that were cunningly labelled backwards. And also, throughout history, the more politically conscious butler has taken it on trust, and with rather more justification, that his employers will not notice if the whisky is topped up with any roux. And what would you like to drink? he said, wondering where the auditor kept its mouth. His hand hovered for just a moment over the smallest decanter, marked Nozyop. We do not drink. But you did just say I could offer you a drink. Indeed. We judge you fully capable of performing that action. Ah. Downey's hand hesitated over the whiskey decanter, and then he thought better of it. At that point, the speaking tube whistled. Yes, Mr. Winrow? Really? Indeed. I myself have frequently found loose change under sofa cushions. It's amazing how it ma... No, 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 I, I wasn't being... Yes, I did have some reason to... Uh, no, no blame attaches to you in any... No, no, I could hardly see how... It... Uh, yes? Yes, Mr. Winrow, go and have a rest. What a good idea. Thank you. He hung up the tube again. The cowl hadn't moved. We will need to know where, when, and, of course, <clears throat> who, he said after a moment. The cowl nodded. The location is not on any map. We would like the task to be completed within the week. This is essential. As for the who... A drawing appeared on Downey's desk, and in his head arrived the words, Let us call him the Fat Man. Is this a joke? said Downey. We do not joke. No, no, you don't, do you? Downey thought. He drummed his fingers. There are many who would say this uh, person does not exist, he said. He must exist. How else could you so readily recognize his picture? And many are in correspondence with him. Well, yes, of course, in a sense he exists. In a sense, everything exists. It is cessation of existence that concerns us here. Uh, finding him would be a little difficult. You will find persons on any street who can tell you his approximate address. Yes, of course, said Downey, wondering why anyone would call them persons. It was an odd usage. But as you say, I doubt that they could give a map reference. And even then... How could the, uh, the uh, fat man be inhumed? A glass of poison sherry, perhaps? The cowl had no face to crack a smile. 
You misunderstand the nature of employment, it said in Downey's head. He bridled at this. Assassins were never employed. They were engaged, or retained, or commissioned, but never employed. Only servants were employed. Well, what is it that I misunderstand exactly, he said. We pay. You find the ways and means. The cowl began to fade. How can I contact you? said Downey. We will contact you. We know where you are. We know where everyone is. The figure vanished. At the same moment, the door was flung open to reveal the distraught figure of Mr. Winvoe, the guild treasurer. Excuse me, my lord, but I really had to come up. He flung some discs on the desk. Look at them. Downey carefully picked up a golden circle. It looked like a small coin, but... No denomination, said Winvo. No heads, no tails, no milling, just a blank disc. They're all just blank discs. Downey opened his mouth to say, Valueless? He realised that he was half hoping this was the case. If they, whoever they were, had paid in worthless metal, then there wasn't even the glimmering of a contract. But he could see this wasn't the case. Assassins learned to recognise money early in their careers. Blank discs, he said, of pure gold. Winvo nodded mutely. That, said Downey, will do nicely. It must be magical, said Winvo, and we never accept magical money. Downey bounced the coin on the desk a couple of times. It made a satisfyingly rich thunking noise. It wasn't magical. Magical money would look real because its whole purpose was to deceive. But this didn't need to ape something as human and adulterated as mere currency. This is gold, it told his fingers. Take it or leave it. Downey sat and thought while Winvo stood and worried. We'll take it, he said. But thank you, Mr. Winvo, that is my decision, said Downey. He stared into space for a while and then smiled. Is <clears throat> Mr. Tea Time still in the building? Winvo stood back. I thought the council had agreed to dismiss him, he said stiffly. After that business with、uh, Mr. Tea Time does not see the world in quite the same way as other people, said Downey, picking up the picture from his desk and looking at it thoughtfully. Well, indeed, I, I think that is certainly true. Please send him up. The guild attracted all sorts of people, Downey reflected. He found himself wondering how it had come to attract Winvo, for one thing. It was hard to imagine him stabbing anyone in the heart in case he got blood on the victim's wallet. Whereas, Mr. Tea Time. The problem was that the Guild took young boys and gave them a splendid education and incidentally taught them how to kill, cleanly and dispassionately, for money and for the good of society, or at least that part of society that had money and what other kind of society was there. But very occasionally, you found you'd got someone like Mr. Tea Time, to whom the money was merely a distraction. Mr. Tea Time had a truly brilliant mind, but it was brilliant like a fractured mirror, all marvellous facets and rainbows, but ultimately also something that was broken. Mr. Tea Time enjoyed himself too much, and other people also. Downey had privately decided that sometime soon Mr. Tea Time was going to meet with an accident. Like many people with no actual morals, Lord Downey did have standards, and tea time repelled him. Assassination was a careful game, usually played against people who knew the rules themselves, or at least could afford the services of those who did. There was considerable satisfaction in a clean kill. What there wasn't supposed to be was pleasure in a messy one. That sort of thing led to talk. On the other hand, Tea Time's corkscrew of a mind was exactly the tool to deal with something like this. And if he didn't, well, that was hardly down his fault, was it? He turned his attention to the paperwork for a while. It was amazing how the stuff mounted up. But you had to deal with it. It wasn't as though they were murderers, after all. There was a knock at the door. He pushed the paperwork aside and sat back. Come in, Mr. Tea Time, he said. It never hurt to put the other fellows slightly in awe of you. In fact, the door was opened by one of the guild's servants, carefully balancing a tea tray. Ah, Carter, said Lord Downey, recovering magnificently. Just put it on the table over there, will you? Yes, sir, said Carter. He turned and nodded. Sorry, sir, I will go and fetch another cup directly, sir. What? For your visitor, sir. 
What visitor? Oh, when Mr. T. Ta. He stopped. He turned. There was a young man sitting on the hearth rug playing with the dogs. Mr. T. Time. It's pronounced T. A. Tim. E. Sir said T. Time with just a hint of reproach. Everyone gets it wrong, sir. How did you do that? Pretty well, sir. I got mildly scorched on the last few feet, of course. There were some lumps of soot on the hearth rug. Downey realised he'd heard them fall, but that hadn't been particularly extraordinary. No one could get down the chimney. There was a heavy grid firmly placed near the top of the flue. But there's a blocked-in fireplace behind the old library," said Tea Time, apparently reading his thoughts. "The flues connect under the bars. It was really a stroll, sir. Really? Oh yes, sir." Downey nodded. The tendency of old buildings to be honeycombed with sealed chimney flues was a fact you learned early in your career. And then he told himself you forgot. It always paid to put the other fellow in awe of you too. He had forgotten they taught that too. The dogs seem to like you, he said. I get on well with animals, sir. Tea Time's face was young and open and friendly, or at least it smiled all the time. But the effect was spoiled for most people by the fact that it had only one eye. Some unexplained accident had taken the other one, and the missing orb had been replaced by a ball of glass. The result was disconcerting, but what bothered Lord Downey far more was the man's other eye, the one that might loosely be called normal. He'd never seen such a small and sharp pupil. Tea time looked at the world through a pinhole. He found he'd retreated behind his desk again. There was that about tea time you always felt happier if you had something between you and him. You like animals, do you? He said. I have a report here that says you nailed Sir George's dog to the ceiling. Couldn't have it barking while I was working, sir. Some people would have drugged it. Oh, Tea Time looked despondent for a moment, but then he brightened. But I definitely fulfilled the contract, sir. There can be no doubt about that, sir. I checked Sir George's breathing with a mirror as instructed. It's in my report. Yes, indeed. Apparently, the man's head had been several feet from his body at that point. It was a terrible thought that tea time might see nothing incongruous about this. And the、um, <clears throat> the servants, he said, couldn't have them bursting in, sir. Downey nodded, half hypnotized by the glassy stare and the pinhole eyeball. No, you couldn't have them bursting in. And an assassin might well face serious professional opposition, possibly even by people trained by the same teachers. But an old man and a maid servant who'd merely had the misfortune to be in the house at the time, there was no actual rule. Downey had to admit it was just that over the years the guild had developed a certain ethos, and members tended to be very neat about their work, even shutting doors behind them and generally tidying up as they went. Hurting the harmless was worse than a transgression against the moral fabric of society; it was a breach of good manners. It was worse even than that; it was bad taste. But there was no actual rule. That was all right, wasn't it, sir? Said Tea Time with apparent anxiety. It <clears throat> it lacked elegance, said Downey. Ah, thank you, sir. I am always happy to be corrected. I shall remember that next time. Downey took a deep breath. It's about that I wish to talk, he said. He held up the picture of、uh, what had the thing called him. The fat man. As a matter of interest, he said, "How would you go about inhuming this gentleman?" Anyone else, he was sure, would have burst out laughing. They would have said things like, "Is this a joke, sir?" Tea time merely leaned forward with a curious, intent expression. Difficult, sir. Certainly, Downey agreed. I would need some time to prepare a plan, sir. Tea time went on. Of course, and. There was a knock at the door, and Carter came in with another cup and saucer. He nodded respectfully to Lord Downey and crept out again. Right, sir," said Tea Time. "I'm sorry," said Downey, momentarily distracted. "I have now thought of a plan, sir," said Tea Time patiently. "You have?" "Yes, sir." "As quickly as that?" "Yes, sir." "Ye gods." "Well, sir, you know we are encouraged to consider hypothetical problems." Oh yes, yes, a very valuable exercise. Downey stopped and then looked shocked. 
You mean you have actually devoted time to considering how to inhume the Hog Father? He said weakly. You've actually sat down and thought out how to do it. You've actually devoted your spare time to the problem. Oh yes, sir, and the Soul Cake Duck and the Sandman and Death. Downey blinked again. You've actually sat down and considered how. Yes, sir. I've amassed quite an interesting file in my own time, of course. I want to be quite certain about this, Mister Tea Time. You have applied yourself to a study of ways of killing death, only as a hobby, sir. Well, yes, hobbies. Yes, I mean, I used to collect butterflies myself. Said Downey, recalling those first moments of awakening pleasure at the use of poison and the pin, but actually, sir, the basic methodology is exactly the same as it would be for a human: opportunity, geography, technique. You just have to work with the known facts about the individual concerned. Of course, with this one, such a lot is known. And you've worked it all out, have you? Said Downey, almost fascinated. Oh, a long time ago, sir. When may I ask? I think it was when I was lying in bed one hog's watch night, sir. My gods, thought Downey, and to think that I just used to listen for sleigh bells. My word, he said aloud. I may have to check some details, sir. I'd appreciate access to some of the books in the dark library, but yes, I think I can see the basic shape. And yet, this person, some people might say that he is technically immortal. Everyone has their weak point, sir. Even death? Oh yes, absolutely, very much so. Really? Downey drummed his fingers on the desk again. The boy couldn't possibly have a real plan. He told himself. He certainly had a skewed mind. Skewed? It was a positive helix. But the fat man wasn't just another target in some mansion somewhere. It was reasonable to assume that people had tried to trap him before. He felt happy about this. Tea time would fail, and possibly even fail fatally, if his plan was stupid enough. And maybe the guild would lose the gold, but maybe not. Very well, he said. I don't need to know what your plan is. That's just as well, sir. What do you mean? Because I don't propose to tell you, sir. You'd be obliged to disapprove of it. I am amazed that you are so confident that it can work. Tea time. I just think logically about the problem, sir," said the boy. He sounded reproachful. "Logically," said Downey. "I suppose I just see things differently from other people," said Tea Time. It was a quiet day for Susan, although on the way to the park, Gawain trod on a crack in the pavement on purpose. One of the many terrors conjured up by the previous governess's happy way with children had been the bears that waited around in the street to eat you. If you stood on the cracks, Susan had taken to carrying the poker under her respectable coat. One wallop generally did the trick. They were amazed that anyone else saw them. Gawain, she said, eyeing a nervous bear who had suddenly spotted her and was now trying to edge away nonchalantly. Yes, you meant to tread on that crack so that I'd have to thump some poor creature whose only fault is wanting to tear you limb from limb. I was just skipping, quite. Real children don't go hoppity skip, unless they're on drugs. He grinned at her. If I catch you being twee again, I will knot your arms behind your head," said Susan levelly. He nodded and went to push Twyla off the swings. Susan relaxed, satisfied. It was her personal discovery. Ridiculous threats didn't worry them at all, but they were obeyed, especially the ones in graphic detail. The previous governess had used various monsters and bogeymen as a form of discipline. There was always something waiting to eat or carry off bad boys and girls for crimes like stuttering or defiantly and aggravatingly persisting in writing with their left hand. There was always a scissor man waiting for a little girl who sucked her thumb. Always a bogeyman in the cellar. Of such bricks is the innocence of childhood constructed. Susan's attempts at getting them to disbelieve in the things only caused the problems to get worse. Twyla had started to wet the bed. This may have been a crude form of defence against the terrible clawed creature that she was certain lived under it. Susan had found out about this one the first night when the child had woken up crying because of a bogeyman in the closet. 
She'd sighed and gone to have a look. She'd been so angry that she'd pulled it out, hit it over the head with a nursery poker, dislocated its shoulder as a means of emphasis, and kicked it out the back door. The children refused to disbelieve in the monsters, because, frankly, they knew damn well the things were there. But she'd found that they could very firmly also believe in the poker. Now she sat down on a bench and read a book. She made a point of taking the children every day somewhere they could meet others of the same age. If they got the hang of the playground, she thought, adult life would hold no fears. Besides, it was nice to hear the voices of little children at play, provided you took care to be far enough away not to hear what they were actually saying. There were lessons later on. These were going a lot better now she'd got rid of the reading books about bouncy balls and dogs called Spot. She'd got Gawain onto the military campaigns of General Tacticus, which were suitably bloodthirsty, but more importantly considered too difficult for a child. As a result, his vocabulary was doubling every week, and he could already use words like disemboweled in everyday conversation. After all, what was the point in teaching children to be children? They were naturally good at it. And she was, to her mild horror, naturally good with them. She wondered suspiciously if this was a family trait. And if, to judge by the way her hair so readily knotted itself into a prim bun, she was destined for jobs like this for the rest of her life. It was her parents' fault. They hadn't meant it to turn out like this. At least, she hoped charitably that they hadn't. They'd wanted to protect her, to keep her away from the worlds outside this one, from what people thought of as the occult, from, well, from her grandfather, to put it bluntly. This had, she felt, left her a little twisted up. Of course, to be fair, that was a parent's job. The world was so full of sharp bends that if they didn't put a few twists in you, you wouldn't stand a chance of fitting in. And they'd been conscientious and kind and given her a good home and even an education. It had been a good education, too. But it had only been later that she'd realised that it had been an education in... in... well, in education. It meant that if ever anyone needed to calculate the volume of a cone, then they could confidently call on Susan Stowe Hellett. Anyone at a loss to recall the campaigns of General Tacticus or the square root of 27.4 would not find her wanting. If you needed someone who could talk about household items and things to buy in the shops in five languages, then Susan was at the head of the queue. Education had been easy. Learning things had been harder. Getting an education was a bit like a communicable sexual disease. It made you unsuitable for a lot of jobs, and then you had the urge to pass it on. She'd become a governess. It was one of the few jobs a known lady could do. And she'd taken to it well. She'd sworn that if she did indeed ever find herself dancing on rooftops with chimney sweeps, she'd beat herself to death with her own umbrella. After tea, she read them a story. They liked her stories. The one in the book was pretty awful, but the Susan version was well received. She translated as she read. And then Jack chopped down the beanstalk, adding murder and ecological vandalism to the theft, enticement and trespass charges already mentioned, but he got away with it and lived happily ever after without so much as a guilty twinge about what he'd done, which proves that you can be excused just about anything if you're a hero, because no one asks inconvenient questions. And now, she closed the book with a snap, it's time for bed. The previous governess had taught them a prayer which included the hope that some god or other would take their soul if they died while they were asleep, and if Susan was any judge, had the underlying message that this would be a good thing. One day Susan averred she'd hunt that woman down. Susan, said Twyla from somewhere under the blankets, yes? You know last week we wrote letters to the Hogfather? Yes. Only... In the park, Rachel says he doesn't exist, and it's your father, really, and everyone else said she was right. There was a rustle from the other bed. Twyla's brother had turned over and was listening surreptitiously. Oh, dear, thought Susan. She had hoped she could avoid this. It was going to be like that business with the soul cake duck all over again. Does it matter if you get the presents anyway, she said, making a direct appeal to greed. Yes. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Susan sat down on the bed, wondering how the hell to get through this. She patted the one visible hand. Look at it this way, then, she said, and took a deep mental breath. Wherever people are obtuse and absurd, and wherever they have, by even the most generous standards, the attention span of a small chicken in a hurricane, and the investigative ability of a one-legged cockroach, and wherever people are inanely credulous, pathetically attached to the certainties of the nursery, and in general 
have as much grasp of the realities of the physical universe as an oyster has of mountaineering. Yes, Twyla, there is a hogfather. There was silence from under the bedclothes, but she sensed that the tone of voice had worked. The words had meant nothing. That, as her grandfather might have said, was humanity all over. Good night. Good night, said Susan. It wasn't even a bar. It was just a room where people drank while they waited for other people with whom they had business. The business usually involved the transfer of ownership of something from one person to another. But then what business doesn't? Five businessmen sat round a table lit by a candle stuck in a saucer. There was an open bottle between them. They were taking some care to keep it away from the candle flame. It's gone six, said one, a huge man with dreadlocks and a beard you could keep goats in. The clock struck ages ago. He ain't coming. Let's go. Sit down, will you? Assassins are always late cause of style, right? This one's mental, eccentric. What's the difference? A bag of cash. The three that hadn't spoken yet looked at one another. <laughs> well, well, what's this? You never said he was an assassin, said Chickenwire. He never said the guy was an assassin, d d did he, Banjo? There was a sound like distant thunder. It was Banjo Lillywhite clearing his throat. <sighs> That's right, said a voice from the upper slopes. You's never said. The others waited until the rumble died away. Even Banjo's voice hulked. He's... The first speaker waved his hands vaguely, trying to get across the point that someone was a hamper of food, several folding chairs, a tablecloth, an assortment of cooking gear, and an entire colony of ants short of a picnic. Mental. And he's got a funny eye. It's just glass, all right, said the one known as Cat's Eye, signalling a waiter for four beers and a glass of milk. And he's paying ten thousand dollars each. I don't care what kind of eye he's got. I heard it was made of the same stuff they make them fortune-telling crystals out of. You can't tell me that's right. And he looks at you with it, said the first speaker. He was known as Peachy, although no one had ever found out why. Peachy was not someone you generally asked questions of, except the sort that go like, If, 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 if I give you all my money, could you possibly not break the other leg? Thank you so much. Cat's eye sighed. Certainly there was something odd about Mr. Tea Time. There was no doubt about that. But there was something weird about all assassins. And the man paid well. Lots of assassins used informers and locksmiths. It was against the rules, technically, but standards were going down everywhere, weren't they? Usually they paid you late and sparsely, as if they were doing the favour. But Tea Time was OK. True, after a few minutes of talking to him, your eyes began to water, and you felt you needed to scrub your skin even on the inside. But no one was perfect, were they? Peachy leaned forward. You know what, he said. I reckon he could be here already, in disguise, laughing at us. Well, if he's in here laughing at us, he cracked his knuckles. Medium Dave Lillywhite, the last of the five, looked around. There were indeed a number of solitary figures in the low, dark room. Most of them wore cloaks with big hoods. They sat alone in corners, hidden by the hoods. None of them looked very friendly. So be daft, Peachy, Cat's Eye murmured. That's the sort of thing they do, Peachy insisted. They're masters of disguise. With that eye of his? That guy sitting by the fire has got an eye patch, said Medium Dave. Medium Dave didn't speak much. He watched a lot. The others turned to stare. He'll wait till we're off our guard, then go, Aha! said Peachy. They can't kill you unless it's for money, said Cat's Eye. But now there was a soupçon of doubt in his voice. They kept their eyes on the hooded man. He kept his eye on them. If asked to describe what they did for a living, the five men around the table would have said something like, This and that, or, <laughs> The best I can. Although in Banjo's case, he'd have probably said, Duh! They were, by the standards of an uncaring society, criminals, although they wouldn't have thought of themselves as such, and couldn't even spell words like nefarious. 
What they generally did was move things around. Sometimes the things were in fact people, who were far too unimportant to trouble the Assassin's Guild with, but who were nevertheless inconveniently positioned where they were and could much better be located on, for example, a seabed somewhere. Chicken Wire had got his name from his own individual contribution to the science of this very specialised concrete overshoe form of waste disposal. An unfortunate drawback of the process was the tendency for bits of the client to eventually detach and float to the surface, causing much comment in the general population. Enough chicken wire, he'd pointed out, would solve that, while also allowing the ingress of crabs and fish going about their vital recycling activities. None of the five belonged to any formal guild, and they generally found their clients among those people who, for their own dark reasons, didn't want to put the guilds to any trouble sometimes because they were guild members themselves. They had plenty of work. There was always something that needed transferring from A to B, or, of course, to the bottom of the C. Any minute now, said Peachy, as the waiter brought their beers. Banjo cleared his throat. This was a sign that another thought had arrived. What I don't understand, he said, is... Yes, said his brother. Ark Morpork's underworld, which was so big that the overworld floated around on top of it like a very small hen trying to mother a nest of ostrich chicks, already had Big Dave, Fat Dave, Mad Dave, Wee Davy, and Lanky Die. Everyone had to find their niche. What I don't understand is how long has this place had waiters? Good evening, said Tea Time, putting down the tray. And they stared at him in silence. He gave them a friendly smile. Peachy's huge hand slapped the table. You crept up on us, you little, he began. Men in their line of business develop a certain prescience. Medium Dave and Cat's Eye, who were sitting on either side of Peachy, leaned away nonchalantly. Hi, said Tea Time. There was a blur and a knife shuddered in the table between Peachy's thumb and index finger. He looked down at it in horror. My name's Teatime, said Tea Time. Which one are you? I'm Peachy, said Peachy, still staring at the vibrating knife. That's an interesting name, said Tea Time. Why are you called Peachy, Peachy? Medium Dave coughed. Peachy looked up into Tea Time's face. The glass eye was a mere ball of faintly glowing grey. The other eye was a little dot in a sea of white. Peachy's only contact with intelligence had been to beat it up and rob it whenever possible but a sudden sense of self-preservation glued him to his chair. "'Cause I don't shave,' he said. "'Peachy don't like blades, mister,' said Cat's Eye. "'And do you have a lot of friends, Peachy?' said Tea Time. "'Got a few, yeah?' With a sudden whirl of movement that made the men start, Tea Time spun away, grabbed a chair, swung it up to the table and sat down on it. Three of them had already got their hands on their swords. I don't have many, he said apologetically. Don't seem to have the knack. On the other hand, I don't seem to have any enemies at all. Not one. Isn't that nice? Tea time had been thinking in the cracking, buzzing firework display that was his head. What he had been thinking about was immortality. He might have been quite, quite insane, but he was no fool. There were in the Assassin's Guild a number of paintings and busts of famous members who had in the past put... No, of course that wasn't right. There were paintings and busts of the famous clients of members with a noticeably modest brass plaque screwed somewhere nearby bearing some unassuming little comment like Departed this veil of tears on Groon Three, Year of the Sideways Leech with the assistance of the Honourable K.W. Dobson, Viper House. Many fine old educational establishments had dignified memorials in some hall, listing the old boys who had laid down their lives for Monarch and country. The Gills was very similar, except for the question of whose life had been laid. Every Guild member wanted to be up there somewhere, because getting up there represented immortality. And the bigger your client, the more incredibly discreet and restrained would be the little brass plaque, so that everyone couldn't help but notice your name. In fact, if you were very, very renowned, they wouldn't even have to write down your name at all. The men around the table watched him. 
It was always hard to know what Banjo was thinking, or even if he was thinking at all, but the other four were thinking along the lines of, "'Bumptious little tit, like all assassins, thinks he knows it all. I could take him down one-handed, no trouble. But you hear stories, those eyes give me the creeps.' "'So, <laughs> what's the job?' said Chicken Wire. "'We don't do jobs,' said Tea Time. "'We perform services, and the service will earn each of you ten thousand dollars.' "'That's a lot more than Thieves' Guild's rate,' said Medium Dave. "'I've never liked the Thieves' Guild,' said Tea Time, without turning his head. "'Why not? They ask too many questions.' "'We don't ask questions,' said Chicken Wire, quickly. "'We shall suit one another perfectly.' said Tea Time. Do have another drink while we wait for the other members of our little troop. Chicken Wire saw Medium Dave's lips start to frame the opening letters, Who? These letters he deemed inauspicious at this time. He kicked Medium Dave's leg under the table. The door opened slightly. A figure came in, but only just. It inserted itself in the gap and sidled along the wall in a manner calculated not to attract attention. Calculated, that is, by someone... Not good at this sort of calculation. It looked at them over its turned-up collar. "'That's a wizard,' said Peachy. The figure hurried over and dragged up a chair. "'No, I, I'm not,' it hissed. "'I'm... I'm incognito.' "'Right, Mr. Nito,' said Medium Dave. "'You're just someone in a pointy hat. "'This is my brother Banjo. "'That's Peachy. "'This is Chicken.' The wizard looked desperately at tea time. I, 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 I didn't want to come. Mr. Sidney here is indeed a wizard, said tea time, a student anyway, but down on his luck at the moment, hence his willingness to join us on this venture. Exactly how far down on his luck, said Medium Dave. The wizard tried not to meet anyone's gaze. I made a, a, a misjudgment to do with a wager, he said. "'Lost a bet, you mean?' said Chicken Wire. "'I paid up on time,' said Sidney. "'Yes, but Chryso praise the troll has this odd little thing about money that turns into lead the next day,' said Tea Time cheerfully, "'so our friend needs to earn a little cash in a hurry, and in a climate where arms and legs stay on.' "'No one said anything about there being magic in all this,' said Peachy. "'Our destination is... Probably you should think of it as something like a wizard's tower, gentlemen, said Tea Time. It isn't an actual wizard's tower, is it? said Medium Dave. They got a very odd sense of humour when it comes to booby traps. No. Guards? I believe so, according to legend, but nothing very much. Medium Dave narrowed his eyes. There's valuable stuff in this tower? Oh, yes. Why ain't there many guards, then? The... Person who owns the property probably does not realise the value of uh, of what they have. Locks, said Medium Dave. On our way, we shall be picking up a locksmith. Who? Mr. Brown. They nodded. Everyone, at least everyone in the business, and everyone in the business knew what the business was, and if you didn't know what the business was, you weren't a businessman, knew Mr. Brown. His presence anywhere around a job gave it a certain kind of respectability. He was a neat, elderly man who'd invented most of the tools in his big leather bag. No matter what cunning you'd use to get into a place, or overcome a small army, or find the secret treasure room, sooner or later you sent for Mr. Brown, who'd turn up with his leather bag, and his little springy things, and his little bottles of strange alchemy, and his neat little boots. And he'd do nothing for ten minutes but look at the lock— and then he'd select a piece of bent metal from a ring of several hundred, almost identical pieces, and under an hour later he'd be walking away with a neat ten percent of the takings. Of course, you didn't have to use Mr. Brown's services. You could always opt to spend the rest of your life looking at a locked door. All right. Where is this place? said Peachy. Tea time turned and smiled at him. If I'm paying you, why isn't it me who's asking the questions? Peachy didn't even try to outstare the glass eye a second time. Just want to be prepared, that's all, he mumbled. Good reconnaissance is the essence of a successful operation, said Tea Time. He turned and looked up at the bulk that was Banjo and added, What is this? This is Banjo, said Medium Dave, rolling himself a cigarette. Does it do tricks? 
Time stood still for a moment. The other men looked at Medium Dave. He was known to Unc Morpork's professional underclass as a thoughtful, patient man, and considered something of an intellectual, because some of his tattoos were spelled right. He was reliable in a tight spot, and above all, he was honest, because good criminals have to be honest. If he had a fault, it was a tendency to deal out terminal and definitive retribution to anyone who said anything about his brother. If he had a virtue, it was a tendency to pick his time. Medium Dave's fingers tucked the tobacco into the paper and raised it to his lips. Nope, he said. Chicken Wire tried to defrost the conversation. He's not what you'd call <laughs> bright, but he's, he's always useful. He can lift two men in each hand <laughs> by their necks. Yeah, said Banjo. He looks like a volcano, said Tea Time. Really, said Medium Dave Lillywhite. Chicken Wire reached out hastily and pushed him back down in his seat. Tea Time turned and smiled at him. I do so hope we're going to be friends, Mr. Medium Dave, he said. It really hurts to think I might not be among friends. He gave him another bright smile. Then he turned back to the rest of the table. Are we resolved, gentlemen? They nodded. There was some reluctance, given the consensus view that Tea Time belonged in a room with soft walls, but ten thousand dollars was ten thousand dollars. Possibly even more. Good, said Tea Time. He looked Banjo up and down. Then I suppose we might as well make a start. And he hit Banjo very hard in the mouth. Death in person did not turn up upon the cessation of every life. It was not necessary. Governments govern, but prime ministers and presidents do not personally turn up in people's homes to tell them how to run their lives because of the mortal danger this would present. There are laws instead. But from time to time, death checked up to see that things were functioning properly, or to put it another and more accurate way, properly ceasing to function in the less significant areas of his jurisdiction. And now he walked through dark seas. Silt rose in clouds around his feet as he strode along the trench bottom. His robes floated out around him. There was silence, pressure, and utter, utter darkness. But there was life down here, even this far below the waves. There were giant squid and lobsters with teeth on their eyelids. There were spidery things with their stomachs on their feet, and fish that made their own light. It was a quiet, black, nightmare world, but life lives everywhere that life can. Where life can't, this takes a little longer. Death's destination was a slight rise in the trench floor. Already the water around him was getting warmer and more populated, by creatures that looked as though they had been put together from bits left over from everything else. Unseen, but felt, a vast column of scalding hot water was welling up from a fissure. Somewhere below were rocks heated to near incandescence by the disk's magical field. Spires of minerals had been deposited around this vent, and in this tiny oasis a type of life had grown up. It did not need air or light. It did not even need food in the way that most other species would understand the term. It just grew at the edge of the streaming column of water, looking like a cross between a worm and a flower. Death kneeled down and peered at it, because it was so small. But for some reason, in this world without eyes or light, it was also a brilliant red. The profligacy of life in these matters never ceased to amaze him. He reached inside his robe and pulled out a small roll of black material, like a jeweller's tool kit. With great care, he took from one of its pouches a scythe about an inch long, and held it expectantly between thumb and forefinger. Somewhere overhead, a shard of rock was dislodged by a stray current and tumbled down, raising little puffs of silt as it bounced off the tubes. It landed just beside the living flower, and then rolled, wrenching it from the rock. Death flicked the tiny scythe just as the bloom faded. The omnipotent eyesight of various supernatural entities is often remarked upon. It is said that they can see the fall of every sparrow, and this may be true, but there is only one who is always there when it hits the ground. The soul of the tube worm was very small and uncomplicated. It wasn't bothered about sin. It had never coveted its neighbor's polyps. It had never gambled or drunk strong liquor. It had never bothered itself with questions like, Why am I here? Because it had no concept at all of here, or, for that matter, of I. Nevertheless, something was cut free under the surgical edge of the scythe and vanished in the roiling waters. Death carefully put the instrument away and stood up. All was well, 
Things were functioning satisfactorily, and... but they weren't. In the same way that the best of engineers can hear the tiny change that signals a bearing going bad long before the finest of instruments would detect anything wrong, death picked up a discord in the symphony of the world. It was one wrong note among billions, but all the more noticeable for that, like a tiny pebble in a very large shoe. He waved a finger in the waters. For a moment a blue door-shaped outline appeared. He stepped through it and was gone. The tube creatures didn't notice him go. They hadn't noticed him arrive. They never ever noticed anything. A cart trundled through the freezing, foggy streets. The driver hunched in his seat. He seemed to be all big, thick brown overcoat. A figure darted out of the swirls and was suddenly on the box next to him. Hi, it said. My name's Teatime. What's yours? Here, you get down. I ain't allowed to give lift. The driver stopped. It was amazing how Tea Time had been able to thrust a knife through four layers of thick clothing and stop it just at the point where it pricked the flesh. Sorry, said Tea Time, smiling brightly. Er, uh, there ain't nothing valuable, you know, nothing valuable, only a few bags of... Oh, dear, said Tea Time, his face a sudden acre of concern. Well, we'll just have to see, won't we? What is your name, sir? Ernie. Uh, Ernie, said Ernie. Yes, er, uh, Ernie. Um. Tea Time turned his head slightly. Come along, gentlemen. This is my friend Ernie. He's going to be our driver for tonight. Ernie saw half a dozen figures emerge from the fog and climb into the cart behind him. He didn't turn to look at them. By the pricking of his kidneys, he knew this would not be an exemplary career move. But it seemed that one of the figures, a huge, shambling mound of a creature, was carrying a long bundle over its shoulders. The bundle moved and made muffled noises. Do stop shaking, Ernie. We just need a lift, said Tea Time as the cart rumbled over the cobbles. Where to, mister? Oh, we don't mind. But first I'd like you to stop in Sator Square, near the second fountain. The knife was withdrawn. Ernie stopped trying to breathe through his ears. Er, uh, what is it? You do seem tense, Ernie. I always find a neck massage helps. I ain't rightly allowed to carry passengers, see. Charlie'll give me a right telling off. Oh, don't you worry about that, said Tea Time, slapping him on the back. We're all friends here. What are we bringing the girl for? said a voice behind them. It's not right hitting girls, said a deep voice. Our mam said no hitting girls. Only bad boys do that, our mam said. You be quiet, Banjo. Our mam said... Shh! Ernie here doesn't want to listen to our troubles, said Tea Time, not taking his gaze off the driver. Me? Deaf as a post, me, burbled Ernie, who in some ways was a very quick learner. Can't hardly see more than a few feet, neither. Got no recollection for them faces that I do see, come to that. <laughs> bad memory? <laughs> Talk about bad memory. God! Sometimes I can be, like as it were, on the cart, talking to people, <laughs> just like I'm talking to you now. And then when they're gone, oh, try as I might, do you think I can remember anything about them, or how many there were, or what they were carrying, or anything about any girl, or anything? By this time his voice was a high-pitched wheeze. <laughs> Sometimes I forget my own name. It's Ernie, isn't it? said Tea Time, giving him a happy smile. Ah, and here we are. Oh, dear, there seems to be some excitement. There was the sound of fighting somewhere ahead. Then a couple of masked trolls ran past with three watchmen after them. They all ignored the cart. I heard the British gang were going to have a go at Packley's strong room tonight, said a voice behind Ernie. Looks like Mr. Brown won't be joining us then, said another voice. There was a snigger. Oh, I don't know about that, Mr. Lillywhite. I don't know about that at all, said a third voice, and this one was from the direction of the fountain. Could you take my bag while I climb up, please? Do be careful. It's a little heavy. It was a neat little voice. The owner of a voice like that kept his money in a shovel purse and always counted his change carefully. Ernie thought all this and then tried very hard to forget that he had. On you go, Ernie, said Tea Time, round behind the university, I think. As the cart rolled on, the neat little voice said, You grab all the money and then you get out very smartly, am I right? There was a murmur of agreement. 
Learned that on my mother's knee, yeah. You learned a lot of stuff across your ma's knee, Mr. Lillywhite. Don't you see nothing about our ma'am? The voice was like an earthquake. This is Mr. Brown, Banjo. You smarten up. He didn't ought to talk about our ma'am. All right, all right. Hello, Banjo. I think I may have a sweep somewhere. Yes, there you are. Yes, your ma knew the way, all right. You go in quietly, you take your time, you get what you came for, and you leave smartly and in good order. You don't hang around at the scene to count it all out and tell one another what brave lads you are. Am I right? You seem to have done all right, Mr. Brown. The cart rattled towards the other side of the square. Just a little for expenses, Mr. Cat's Eye. A little hog's watch present, you might say. Never take the lot and run. Take a little and walk. Dress neat, that's my motto. Dress neat and walk away slowly. Never run. Never run. The watch will always chase a running man. They'll run like terriers for giving chase. No, you walk out slow, you walk around the corner, you wait till there's a lot of excitement, then you turn around and walk back. They can't cope with that, see? Half the time they'll stand aside and let you walk past. Good evening, officers, you say, and then you go home for your tea. Whee! Gets you out of trouble, I can see that, if you've got the nerve. Oh no, Mr. Peachy, doesn't get you out of, keeps you out of. It was like a very good schoolroom. Ernie thought, and immediately tried to forget. Or a backstreet gym when a champion prize fighter had just strolled in. What's up with your mouth, Banjo? He's lost a tooth, Mr. Brown, said another voice and sniggered. Lost a tooth, Mr. Brown, said the thunder that was Banjo. Keep your eyes on the road, Ernie, said Tea Time beside him. We don't want an accident, do we? The road here was deserted, despite the bustle of the city behind them and the bulk of the university nearby. There were a few streets, but the buildings were abandoned. And something was happening to the sound. The rest of Ankh Morpork seemed very far away, the sounds arriving as if through quite a thick wall. They were entering that scorned little corner of Ankh Morpork that had long been the site of the university's rubbish pits and was now known as the Unreal Estate. Bludgy wizards, muttered Ernie automatically. I beg your pardon? said Tea Time. My great grandpa said we used to own property round here, low levels of magic, my arse. <laughs> it's all right for them wizards, they got all kinds of spells to protect them. Bit of magic here, bit of magic there. Stands to reason it's got to go somewhere, right? There used to be warning signs up, said the neat voice from behind. Yeah, well, warning signs in Arkmore Pork might as well have good firewood written on them, said someone else. I mean, stands to reason, they took out an old spell for exploding this, and another one for twiddling that, and another one for making carrots grow. They finish up interfering with one another, and who knows what they'll end up doing, said Ernie. Great-grandpa said sometimes they'd wake up in the morning and the cellar'd be higher than the attic. And that weren't the worst, he added darkly. Yeah, I heard where it got so bad you could walk down the street and meet yourself coming the other way. Someone supplied. It's got so's you didn't know it was bum or breakfast time, I heard. The dog used to bring home all kinds of stuff, said Ernie. Great-grandpa said half the time they used to dive behind the sofa if it came in with anything in its mouth. Corroded fire spells starting to fizz, broken ones with green smoke coming out of them, and I don't know what else. And if you saw the cat playing with anything, it was best not to try and find out what it was, I can tell you. He twitched the reins, his current predicament almost forgotten in the tide of hereditary resentment. I mean, they say all the old spell books and stuff was buried deep, and they recycle the used spells now, but that don't seem much comfort when your potatoes started walking about, he grumbled. My great-grandpa went to see the head wizard about it, and he said... He put on a strangled nasal voice, which was his idea of how you talked when you'd got an education. Oh... There might be some temporary inconvenience now, my good man, but just you come back in fifty thousand years. Bloody wizards. The horse turned a corner. This was a dead-end street. Half-collapsed houses, windows smashed, doors stolen, leaned against one another on either side. I heard they said they were going to clean up this place, said someone. Oh, yeah, said Ernie and spat. When it hit the ground, it ran away. And you know what? You get loonies coming in all the time now, poking around, pulling things about. 
"'Just at the wall up ahead,' said Tea Time, conversationally. "'I think you generally go through just where there's a pile of rubble by the old dead tree, "'although you wouldn't see it unless you looked closely. "'But I've never seen how you do it.' "'Here, I can't take you lot through,' said Ernie. "'Lifts is one thing, but not taking people through,' Tea Time sighed. "'And we were getting on so well. "'Listen, Ernie. Earn.' You will take us through, or, and I say this with very considerable regret, I will have to kill you. You seem a nice man, conscientious, a very serious overcoat and sensible boots. But if I take you through... What's the worst that can happen, said Tea Time? You'll lose your job, whereas if you don't, you'll die. So if you look at it like that, we're actually doing you a favour. Oh, do say yes. Er... Uh... Ernie's brain felt twisted up. The lad was definitely what Ernie thought of as a toff, and he seemed nice and friendly, but it didn't all add up. The tone and the content didn't match. Besides, said Tea Time, if you've been coerced, it's not your fault, is it? No one can blame you. No one could blame anyone who'd been coerced at knife point. Oh, oh well, I suppose if we're talking coerced, Ernie muttered. Going along with things seemed to be the only way. The horse stopped and stood waiting with the patient look of an animal that probably knows the route better than the driver. Ernie fumbled in his overcoat pocket and took out a small tin, rather like a snuff-box. He opened it. There was glowing dust inside. "'What do you do with that?' said Tea Time, all interested. "'Oh, you just takes a pinch and throws it in the air and it goes, "'Twing! And it opens the soft place,' said Ernie. "'So... You don't need any special training or anything? Er, uh, you just chucks it at the wall there and it goes twing, said Ernie. Really? May I try? Tea Time took the tin from his unresisting hand and threw a pinch of dust into the air in front of the horse. It hovered for a moment and then produced a narrow, glittering arch in the air. It sparkled and went twing. Oh, said a voice behind them. In that nice, eh, our Davy? Yeah. "'All pretty sparkles.' "'And then you just drive forward?' said Tea Time. "'That's right,' said Ernie. "'Quick, mind, it only stays open for a little while.' Tea Time pocketed the little tin. "'Thank you very much, Ernie. Very much indeed.' His other hand lashed out. There was a glint of metal. The carter blinked and then fell sideways off his seat. There was silence from behind, tinted with horror and possibly just a little terrible admiration. "'Wasn't he dull?' said Tea Time. "'picking up the reins. "'Snow began to fall. "'It fell on the recumbent shape of Ernie, "'and it also fell through several hooded grey robes "'that hung in the air. "'There appeared to be nothing inside them. "'You could believe they were merely there "'to make a certain point in space. "'Well,' said one, "'we are frankly impressed.' "'Indeed,' said another, "'we would never have thought of doing it this way.' He is certainly a resourceful human, said a third. The beauty of it all, said the first, or it may have been the second, because absolutely nothing distinguished the robes, is that there is so much else we will control. Quite, said another. It really is amazing how they think, a sort of illogical logic. Children, said another. Who would have thought it? But today the children, tomorrow the world. "'Give me a child until he is seven, and he is mine for life,' said another. There was a dreadful pause. The consensus beings that called themselves the auditors did not believe in anything, except possibly immortality, and the way to be immortal they knew was to avoid living. Most of all, they did not believe in personality. To be a personality was to be a creature with a beginning and an end, and since they reasoned that in an infinite universe any life was by comparison unimaginably short, they died instantly. There was a flaw in their logic, of course, but by the time they found this out it was always too late. In the meantime, they scrupulously avoided any comment, action, or experience that set them apart. You said, me, said one. Ah, yes, but you see we were quoting, said the other one hurriedly. Some religious person said that, about educating children, and so would logically say me. But I wouldn't use that term of myself. Oh, oh, damn! The robe vanished in a little puff of smoke. Let that be a lesson to us, 
said one of the survivors, as another and totally indistinguishable robe popped into existence where the stricken colleague had been. Yes, said the newcomer. Well, it certainly appears... It stopped. A dark shape was approaching through the snow. It's him, it said. They faded hurriedly, not simply vanishing, but spreading out and thinning until they were just lost in the background. The dark figure stopped by the dead carter and reached down. Could I give you a hand? Ernie looked up gratefully. Cough, yeah, he said. He got to his feet, swaying a little. Here, your finger's cold, mister. Sorry. What did he go and do that for? I did what he said. He could have killed me. Ernie felt inside his overcoat and pulled out a small and at this point strangely transparent silver flask. I always keep a nip on me these cold nights, he said. Keeps me spirits up. Yes, indeed. Death looked around briefly and sniffed the air. How am I going to explain all this then, eh? said Ernie, taking a pull. Sorry. That was very rude of me. I wasn't paying attention. I said, what am I going to tell people? Letting some blokes ride off with my cart neat as you like. That's going to be the sack for sure. I'm going to be in big trouble. Ah, well, there at least I have some good news, Ernest. And then again, I have some bad news. Ernie listened. Once or twice he looked at the corpse at his feet. He looked smaller from the outside. He was bright enough not to argue. Some things are fairly obvious when it's a seven-foot skeleton with a scythe telling you them. So, I'm dead then, he concluded. Correct. Er, uh, the priest said that, you know, after you're dead, it's like going through a door, and on one side of it there's hell, well, a terrible place. Death looked at his worried fading face. Through a door? That's what he said. I expect it depends on the direction you're walking in. When the street was empty again, except for the fleshy abode of the late Ernie, the grey shapes came back into focus. Honestly, he gets worse and worse, said one. He was looking for us, said another. Did you notice? He suspects something. He gets so concerned about things. Yes, but the beauty of this plan, said a third, is that he can't interfere. He can go everywhere, said one. No, said another, not quite everywhere. And with ineffable smugness they faded into the foreground. It started to snow quite heavily. It was the night before Hogswatch. All through the house, one creature stirred. It was a mouse and someone, in the face of all appropriateness, had baited a trap. Although, because it was the festive season, they'd used a piece of pork crackling. The smell of it had been driving the mouse mad all day, but now, with no one about, it was prepared to risk it. The mouse didn't know it was a trap. Mice aren't good at passing on information. Young mice aren't taken up to famous trap sites and told, This is where your Uncle Arthur passed away. All it knew was that, what the hay, there was something to eat. On a wooden board with some wire round it. A brief scurry later, and its jaw had closed on the rind, or rather passed through it. The mouse looked around at what was now lying under the big spring and thought, Oops! Then its gaze went up to the black-clad figure that had faded into view by the wainscoting. Squeak? it asked. Squeak! said the death of rats. And that was it, more or less. Afterwards, the death of rats looked around with interest. In the nature of things, his very important job tended to take him to rickyards and dark cellars and the inside of cats, and all the little dank holes where rats and mice finally found out if there was a promised cheese. This place was different. It was brightly decorated, for one thing. Ivy and mistletoe hung in bunches from the bookshelves. Brightly coloured streamers festooned the walls, a feature seldom found in most holes, or even quite civilised cats. The death of rats took a leap onto a chair, and from there onto the table, and in fact right into a glass of amber liquid which tipped over and broke. A puddle spread around four turnips, and began to soak into a note which had been written rather awkwardly on pink writing paper. It read, Dear Hogfather, For Hog's Watch, I would like a drum, and a dolly, and a teddy bear, and a ghastly Omnian Inquisition torture chamber with wind-up rack and nearly real 
blood you can use again. You can get it from the toy shopper in Short Street. It is five dollars ninety nine. I have been good, and here is a glass of sherry, and a pork pie for you, and turnips for Gouger and Tusker and Rooter and Snot er、uh, Snouter. I hop the chimney is big enough, but my friend William says you are your father really. Yours, Virginia Prude. The death of rats nibbled a bit of the pork pie because when you are the personification of the death of small rodents, you have to behave in certain ways. He also piddled on one of the turnips for the same reason, although only metaphorically, because when you are a small skeleton in a black robe, there are also some things you technically cannot do. Then he leapt down from the table and left sherry-flavored footprints all the way to the tree that stood in a pot in the corner. It was really only a bare branch of oak, but so much shiny holly and mistletoe had been wired onto it that it gleamed in the light of the candles. There was tinsel on it and glittering ornaments, and small bags of chocolate money. The death of rats peered at his hugely distorted reflection in a glass ball and then looked up at the mantelpiece. He reached it in one jump and ambled curiously through the cards that had been ranged along it. His grey whiskers twitched at messages like, "Whiffing you joy and all goody cheer." At Hogswatch time and all through the yearie, a couple of them had pictures of a big jolly fat man carrying a sack. In one of them, he was riding in a sledge drawn by four enormous pigs. The death of rats sniffed at a couple of long stockings that had been hung from the mantelpiece over the fireplace, in which a fire had died down to a few sullen ashes. He was aware of a subtle tension in the air, a feeling that here was a scene that was also a stage, a round hole, as it were, waiting for a round peg. There was a scraping noise. A few lumps of soot thumped into the ashes. The grim squeaker nodded to himself. The scraping became louder and was followed by a moment of silence, and then a clang as something landed in the ashes and knocked over a set of ornamental fire irons. The rat watched carefully as a red-robed figure pulled itself upright and staggered across the hearth rug, rubbing its shin where it had been caught by the toasting fork. It reached the table and read the note. The death of rats thought he heard a groan. The turnips were pocketed, and so, to the death of rats' annoyance, was the pork pie. He was pretty sure it was meant to be eaten here, not taken away. The figure scanned the dripping note for a moment, and then turned around and approached the mantelpiece. The death of rats pulled back slightly behind Stephen's greetings. A red-gloved hand took down a stocking. There was some creaking and rustling as it was replaced, looking a lot fatter. The larger box sticking out of the top had just visible the words. Victim figures not included, three to ten years. The death of rats couldn't see much of the donor of this munificence. The big red hood hid all the face, apart from a long white beard. Finally, when the figure finished, it stood back and pulled a list out of its pocket. It held it up to the hood and appeared to be consulting it. It waved its other hand vaguely at the fireplace, the sooty footprints, the empty sherry glass, and the stocking. Then it bent forward as if reading some tiny print. Ah, yes, it said. Uh, ho, ho, ho! With that, it ducked down and entered the chimney. There was some scrabbling before its boots gained a purchase, and then it was gone. The death of rats realized he'd begun to gnaw his little scythe's handle in sheer shock. Squeak! He landed in the ashes and swarmed up the sooty cave of the chimney. He emerged so fast that he shot out with his legs still scrabbling and landed in the snow on the roof. There was a sledge hovering in the air by the gutter. The red hooded figure had just climbed in and appeared to be talking to someone invisible behind a pile of sacks. Here's another pork pie. Any mustard? Said the sacks. They retreat with mustard. It does not appear so. Ah well, pass it over anyway. It looks very bad. Nah, it's just where something's nibbled it. I mean the situation. Most of the letters. They don't really believe. They pretend to believe, just in case. This is very similar to the suggestion put forward by the Quermian philosopher Vuntra, who said, "Possibly the gods exist, and possibly they do not. So why not believe in them in any case? If it's all true, you'll go to a lovely place when you die, and if it isn't, then you've lost nothing, right?" When he died, he woke up in a circle of gods holding nasty-looking sticks, and one of them said. 
We're going to show you what we think of Mr. Clever Dick in these parts. I fear it may be too late. It has spread so fast and back in time, too. Never say die, master. That's our motto, eh? said the sacks, apparently with their mouth full. I can't say it's ever really been mine. I mean we're not going to be intimidated by the certain prospect of complete and utter failure, master. Aren't we? Oh, good. Well, I suppose we'd better be going. The figure picked up the reins. Up, Gouger, up, Rooter, up, Tusker, up, Snouter, Giddy, up. The four large boars harnessed to the sledge did not move. Why doesn't that work? said the figure in a puzzled, heavy voice. It's me, master, said the sacks. It works on horses. You could try Pig Hooey. Pig Hooey. They waited. No, doesn't seem to reach them. There was some whispering. Really? You think that would work? It'd bloody well work on me if I was a pig master. Very well, then. The figure gathered up the reins again. Apple sauce! The pig's legs blurred. Silver light flicked across them and exploded outwards. They dwindled to a dot and vanished. Squeak! The death of rats skipped across the snow, slid down a drainpipe and landed on the roof of a shed. There was a raven perched there. It was staring disconsolately at something. Squeak! Look at that, will ya? said the raven rhetorically. It waved a claw at a bird table in the garden below. They hangs up half a bloody coconut, a lump of bacon rind, a handful of peanuts in a bit of wire, and they think they're the God's gift to the natural world. Eh! Do I see eyeballs? Do I see entrails? I think not. Most intelligent bird in the temperate latitudes, and I gets the cold shoulder just because I can't hang upside down and go tweet tweet. Look at robins now, stroppy little evil buggers, fight like demons, but all they got to do is go bob bob bobbing along, and they can't move for breadcrumbs. Whereas me myself can recite poems. And repeat many humorous phrases. Squeak. Yes. What? The death of rats pointed at the roof and then the sky and jumped up and down excitedly. The raven swivelled one eye upwards. Ah,、oh, yes, him. He said. Turns up at this time of year. Tends to be associated distantly with robins, which squeak, squeak. The death of rats pantomimed a figure landing in a grate and walking around a room. Squeak, eek, 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 squeak, heek, 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 eek, 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 squeak. Been overdoing the hogs' watch cheer, have you? Been rootling around in the brandy butter. Squeak. The raven's eyes revolved. Look, death's death. It's a full-time job, right? It's not as though you can run like a window cleaning round on the side or nip round after work cutting people's lawns. Squeak! Ah, please yourself. The raven crouched a little to allow the tiny figure to hop onto its back, and then lumbered into the air. Of course, they can go mental, your occult types. It said as it swooped over the moonlit garden. Look at old man Trouble for one. Squeak! Ah,、oh, I'm not suggesting. Susan didn't like beers, but she went there anyway when the pressure of being normal got too much. Beers, despite the smell and the drink and the company, had one important virtue: in beers, no one took any notice of anything. Hogs Watch was traditionally supposed to be a time for families, but the people who drank in beers probably didn't have families. Some of them looked as though they might have had litters or clutches. Some of them looked as though they'd probably eaten their relatives, or at least someone's relatives. Beers was where the undead drank, and when Igor the barman was asked for a Bloody Mary, he didn't mix a metaphor. The regular customers didn't ask questions, and not only because some of them found anything above a growl hard to articulate, 
None of them was in the answers business. Everyone in beers drank alone, even when they were in groups or packs. Despite the decorations put up inexpertly by Igor the barman to show willing, Beers was not a family place. He'd done his best, but black and purple and vomit yellow weren't a good colour combination for paper chains, and no Hogswatch fairy doll should be nailed up by its head. Family was a subject Susan liked to avoid. Currently she was being aided in this by a gin and tonic. In beers, unless you weren't choosy, it paid to order a drink that was transparent because Igor also had undirected ideas about what you could stick on the end of a cocktail stick. If you saw something spherical and green, you just had to hope that it was an olive. She felt hot breath on her ear. A bogeyman had sat down on the stool beside her. Was a normal doing in a place like this, then? It rumbled, causing a cloud of vaporized alcohol and halitosis to engulf her. Ha! Ah, you think it's cool coming down here and swanning around in a black dress with all the lost boys, huh? Dabbling in a bit of designer darkness, huh? Susan moved her stool away a little. The bogeyman grinned. Want a bogeyman under your bed, hmm? Now then, Schlimmerzel, said Igor, without looking up from polishing a glass. Well, what's she down here for, hmm? Huh? said the bogeyman. A huge, hairy hand grabbed Susan's arm. Of course, maybe what she wants is... I ain't telling you again, Schlimmerzell, said Igor. He saw the girl turn to face Schlimmerzell. Igor wasn't in a position to see her face fully, but the bogeyman was. He shot back so quickly that he fell off his stool. And when the girl spoke, what she said was only partly words, but also a statement, written in stone, of how the future was going to be. Go away and stop bothering me. She turned back and gave Igor a polite and slightly apologetic smile. The bogeyman struggled frantically out of the wreckage of his stool and loped towards the door. Susan felt the drinkers turn back to their private preoccupations. It was amazing what you could get away with in beers. Igor put down the glass and looked up at the window. For a drinking den that relied on darkness, it had rather a large one. But of course, some customers did arrive by air. Something was tapping on it now. Igor lurched over and opened it. Susan looked up. Oh, no. The death of rats leapt down onto the counter, with the raven fluttering after it. Squeak! Squeak! Ick! Ick! Squeak! Ick! Ick! Heek! 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 Squeak! Go away, said Susan coldly. I'm not interested. You're just a figment of my imagination. The raven perched on a bowl behind the bar and said, Oh, great! Squeak! What are these? said the raven, flicking something off the end of its beak. Onions! Pfft. Go on, go away, the pair of you, said Susan. The rat says your grandad's gone mad, said the raven. Says he's pretending to be the hog father. Listen, I just... what? Red cloak, long beard, heek, heek, heek. Going ho, 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 driving around in the big sledge drawn by the four piggies, the whole thing. Pigs? What happened to Binky? Search me, cause it can happen, as I was telling the rat only just now. Susan put her hands over her ears, more for desperate theatrical effect than for the muffling they gave. I don't want to know. I don't have a grandfather. She had to hold on to that. The death of rats squeaked at length. The rat says you must remember he's tall and not what you'd call fleshy. He carries a scythe. Go away and take the, the rat with you. She waved her hand wildly and to her horror and shame knocked the little hooded skeleton over an ashtray. Eek! The raven took the rat's cowl in its beak and tried to drag him away, but a tiny skeletal fist shook its scythe. Eek! 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 Squeak! He says you don't mess with the rat, said the raven. In a flurry of wings they were gone. Igor closed the window. He didn't pass any comment. They weren't real, said Susan hurriedly. Well, that is, the raven's probably real, but he hangs around with the, the rat. Which isn't real, said Igor. That's right said Susan gratefully. You probably didn't see a thing. That's right, said Igor. Not a thing. 
"'Now how much do I owe you?' said Susan. Igor counted on his fingers. "'That'll be a dollar for the drinks,' he said, "'and five pence because the raven that wasn't here messed in the pickles.' It was the night before Hogswatch. In the Arch-Chancellor's new bathroom, Modo wiped his hands on a piece of rag and looked proudly at his handiwork. Shining porcelain gleamed back at him. Copper and brass shone in the lamplight. He was a little worried that he hadn't been able to test everything, but Mr. Ridcully had said, "'I'll test it when I use it!' And Modo never argued with the gentlemen, as he thought of them. He knew that they all knew a lot more than he knew, and was quite happy knowing this. He didn't meddle with the fabric of time and space, and they kept out of his greenhouses. The way he saw it, it was a partnership. He'd been particularly careful to scrub the floors. Mr. Ridcully had been very specific about that. Veruca Gnome, he said to himself, giving a tap a last polish. What an imagination the gentlemen do have! Far off, unheard by anyone, was a faint little noise, like the ringing of tiny silver bells. bling a ling 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 and someone landed abruptly in a snowdrift and said bugger, which is a terrible thing to say as your first word ever. Overhead, heedless of the new and somewhat angry life that was even now dusting itself off, the sledge soared onwards through time and space. I'm finding the beard a bit of a trial, said Death. Why have you got to have the beard? said the voice from among the sacks. I thought you said people see what they expect to see. Children don't. Too often they see what's there. Well, at least it's keeping you in the right frame of mind, Master. In character sort of thing. But going down the chimney, where's the sense in that? I can just walk through the walls. Uh, walking through the walls is, is not right neither, said the voice from the sack. It works for me. Yeah, it's got to be chimneys. Same as the beard, really. A head thrust itself out from the pile. It appeared to belong to the oldest, most unpleasant pixie in the universe. The fact that it was underneath a jolly little green hat with a bell on it did not do anything to improve matters. It waved a crabbed hand containing a thick wad of letters, many of them on pastel-coloured paper, often with bunnies and teddy bears on them, and written mostly in crayon. "'You reckon these little buggers be writing to someone who walked through walls?' it said. "'And the ho-ho-ho could use some more work if you, if you don't mind my saying so?' "'Ho!' Ho, ho! No, 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 said Albert. You've got to put a bit of life in it, sir. No offence intended. It's got to be a, a big fat laugh. You've got, to, you've got to sound like you're pissing brandy and crapping plum pudding, sir. Excuse my clatching. Really? How do you know all this? I was young once, sir. Hung up my stocking like a good boy every year. For to get it filled with toys, just like you're doing. Mind you, in those days, basically it was sausages and black puddings, if you were lucky. But you always got a pink sugar piglet in the toe. It wasn't a good hog's watch, unless you'd eaten so much you were sick as a pig master. Death looked at the sacks. It was a strange but demonstrable fact that the sacks of toys carried by the hogfather, no matter what they really contained, always appeared to have sticking out of the top a teddy bear, a toy soldier in the kind of colourful uniform that would stand out in a disco, a drum, and a red and white candy cane. The actual contents always turned out to be something a bit garish and costing five dollars ninety-nine. Death had investigated one or two. There had been a real Agatean ninja, for example, with fearsome death grip and a Captain Carrot one-man night watch, with a complete wardrobe of toy weapons, each of which cost as much as the original wooden doll in the first place. Mind you, the stuff for girls was just as depressing. It seems to be nearly all horses. Most of them were grinning. Horses, death felt, shouldn't grin. Any horse that was grinning was planning something. He sighed again. Then there was this business of deciding who'd be naughty or nice. He'd never had to think about that sort of thing before. Naughty or nice? It was ultimately all the same. Still, it had to be done right, otherwise it wouldn't work. The pigs pulled up alongside another chimney. "'Here we are, here we are,' said Albert. "'James Riddle, aged eight. "'Ah, yes. "'He actually says in his letter, "'I bet you don't exist, "'cause everyone knows it's your parents.' "'Oh, yes,' said Death, "'with what almost sounded like sarcasm.' I'm sure his parents are just impatient 
to bang their elbows in twelve feet of narrow, unswept chimney, I don't think. I shall tread extra soot into his carpet. Right, sir. Good thinking. Speaking of which, down you go, sir. How about if I don't give him anything as a punishment for not believing? Yeah, but、uh, what's that going to prove? Death sighed. I suppose you're right. Did you check the list? Yes, twice. Are you sure that's enough? Definitely. Couldn't really make head or tail of it, to tell you the truth. How can I tell if he's been naughty or nice, for example? Ah,、oh, well,、um, I don't know. Has he hung his clothes up? That sort of thing. And if he has been good, I may give him this Clachian war chariot with real spinning sword blades. That's right. And if he's been bad, Albert scratched his head. When I was a lad, you got a bag of bones. It's amazing how kids got better behaved towards the end of the year. Oh dear! And now, Albert held a package up to his ear and rustled it. Sounds like socks. Socks. Could be a woolly vest. Serve him right, if I may venture to express an opinion. Albert looked across the snowy rooftops and sighed. This wasn't right. He was helping because, well, death was his master, and that's all there was to it. And if the master had a heart, it would be in the right place. But are you sure we ought to be doing this, master? Death stopped halfway out of the chimney. Can you think of a better alternative, Albert? And that was it. Albert couldn't. Someone had to do it. There were bears on the street again. Susan ignored them and didn't even make a point of not treading on the cracks. They just stood around, looking a bit puzzled and slightly transparent, visible only to children. And Susan. News like Susan gets around. The bears had heard about the poker. Nuts and berries. Their expressions seemed to say, "That's what we're here for." Big sharp teeth? What big sharp? Oh, these big sharp teeth! They're just for、um, <laughs> cracking nuts. And some of these berries can be really vicious. The city's clocks were striking six when she got back to the house. She was allowed her own key. It wasn't as if she was a servant exactly. You couldn't be a duchess and a servant, but it was all right to be a governess. It was understood that it wasn't exactly what you were. It was merely a way of passing the time until you did what every girl or gal was supposed to do in life, i.e., marry some man. It was understood that you were playing. The parents were in awe of her. She was the daughter of a duke, whereas Mister Gator was a man to be reckoned with in the wholesale boots and shoes business. Missus Gator was bucking for a transfer into the upper classes, which she currently hoped to achieve by reading books on etiquette. She treated Susan with the kind of worried deference she thought was due to anyone who'd known the difference between a serviette and a napkin from birth. Susan had never before come across the idea that you could rise in society by, as it were, gaining marks. Especially since such noblemen as she'd met in her father's house had used neither serviette nor napkin, but a state of mind which was "drop it on the floor, the dogs will eat it." When Mrs. Gator had tremulously asked her how one addressed the second cousin of a queen, Susan had replied without thinking, "We called him Jamie usually," and Mrs. Gator had had to go and have a headache in her room. Mr. Gator just nodded when he met her in a passage and never said very much to her. He was pretty sure he knew where he stood in boots and shoes, and that was that. Gawain and Twyla, who'd been named by people who apparently loved them, had been put to bed by the time Susan got in, at their own insistence. It's a widely held belief at a certain age that going to bed early makes tomorrow come faster. She went to tidy up the schoolroom and get things ready for the morning, and began to pick up the things the children had left lying around. Then, something tapped at a window pane. She peered out at the darkness and then opened the window. A drift of snow fell down outside. In the summer, the window opened into the branches of a cherry tree. In the winter dark, they were little grey lines where the snow had settled on them. "Who's that?" said Susan. Something hopped through the frozen branches. "Tweet, tweet, tweet! Would you believe?" said the raven. "Not you again." You wanted maybe some dear little Robin. Listen, your grandfather. Go away. Susan slammed the window and pulled the curtains across. She put her back to them to make sure and tried to concentrate on the room. 
it helped to think about normal things. There was the hog's watch tree, a rather smaller version of the grand one in the hall. She'd helped the children to make paper decorations for it. Yes. Think about that. There were the paper chains. There were the bits of holly thrown out from the main rooms for not having enough berries on them, and now given fake modelling clay berries and stuck in anyhow on shelves and behind pictures. There were two stockings hanging from the mantelpiece of the small schoolroom grate. There were Twyla's paintings, all blobby blue skies and violently green grass and red houses with four square windows. There were normal things. She straightened up and stared at them, her fingernails beating a thoughtful tattoo on a wooden pencil case. The door was pushed open. It revealed the tousel shape of Twyla hanging onto the doorknob with one hand. Susan, there's a monster under my bed again. The click of Susan's fingernails stopped. I can hear it moving about. Susan sighed and turned towards the child. All right, Twyla, I'll be along directly. The girl nodded and went back to her room, leaping into bed from a distance as a precaution against claws. There was a metallic thing as Susan withdrew the poker from the little brass stand it shared with the tongs and the coal shovel. She sighed. Normality was what you made it. She went into the children's bedroom and leaned over as if to tuck Twyla up. Then her hand darted down and under the bed. She grabbed a handful of hair. She pulled. The bogeyman came out like a cork, but before it could get its balance, it found itself spread-eagled against the wall with one arm behind its back. But it did manage to turn its head to see Susan's face glaring at it from a few inches away. Gawain bounced up and down on his bed. Do the voice on it! Do the voice on it! He shouted. Don't do the voice! Don't do the voice! Pleaded the bogeyman urgently. Hit it on the head with the poker! Not the poker! Not the poker! It's you, isn't it? Said Susan from this afternoon. Aren't you going to poke it with the poker? Said Gawain. Not the poker! Whined the bogeyman. New in town? Whispered Susan. Yes. The bogeyman's forehead wrinkled with puzzlement. Here, how come you can see me? Then this is a friendly warning. Understand? Because it's Hog's Watch. The bogeyman tried to move. You call this friendly? Ah, you want to try for unfriendly? Said Susan, adjusting her grip. No, no, no. I like friendly. This house is out of bounds, right? You a witch or something? Moaned the bogeyman. I'm just something. Now you won't be around here again, will you? Otherwise, it'll be the blanket next time. No, I mean it. We'll put your head under the blanket. No, it's got fluffy bunnies on it. No, off you go then. The bogeyman half fell, half ran towards the door. Not right, it mumbled. You're not supposed to see us if you ain't dead or magic. It's not fair. Try number nineteen, said Susan, relenting a little. The governess there doesn't believe in bogeymen. Right, said the monster hopefully. She believes in algebra though. Ah,、oh, nice. The bogeyman grinned hugely. It was amazing the sort of mischief that could be caused in a house where no one in authority thought you existed. I'll be off then, it said. Um, happy hogs watch. Possibly, said Susan as it slunk away. That wasn't as much fun as the one last month, said Gawain, getting between the sheets again. You know when you kicked him in the trousers. Just you two get to sleep now, said Susan. Verity said, "The sooner we got to sleep, the sooner the hog father would come." Said Twyla conversationally. "Yes," said Susan. "Unfortunately, that might be the case." The remark passed right over their heads. She wasn't sure why it had gone through hers, but she knew enough to trust her senses. She hated that kind of sense. It ruined your life, but it was the sense she had been born with. The children were tucked in, and she closed the door quietly and went back to the schoolroom. Something had changed. She glared at the stockings, but they were unfulfilled. A paper chain rustled. She stared at the tree. Tinsel had been twined around it. Badly pasted together decorations had been hung on it, and on top was the fairy made of. She crossed her arms, looking up at the ceiling, and sighed theatrically. "It's you, isn't it?" she said. "Squeak." "Yes, it is. You're sticking out your arms like a scarecrow, and you've stuck a little star on your scythe, haven't you?"
The death of rats hung his head guiltily. Squeak! You're not fooling anyone. Squeak! Get down from there this minute. Squeak! And what did you do with the fairy? It shoved under a cushion on the chair, said a voice from the shelves on the other side of the room. There was a clicking noise, and the raven's voice added, These damn eyeballs are hard, aren't they? Susan raced across the room and snatched the bowl away so fast that the raven somersaulted and landed on its back. They are walnuts, she shouted as they bounced around her, not eyeballs. This is a schoolroom, and the difference between a school and a, and, and a raven delicatessen is that they hardly ever have eyeballs lying around in bowls in case a raven drops in for a quick snack. Understand? No eyeballs? The world is full of small round things that aren't eyeballs, okay? The raven's own eyes revolved. And I suppose a bit of warm liver's out of the question? Shut up. I want you both out of here right now. I don't know how you got in here. There's a law against coming down the chimney on Hog's Watch night. But I don't want you back in my life. Understand? The rat said you ought to be warned even if you were crazy, said the raven sulkily. I didn't want to come. There's a donkey drop dead just outside the city gates. I'll be lucky now if I get a hoof. Warned, said Susan. There it was again, the change in the weather of the mind, a sensation of tangible time. The death of rats nodded. There was a scrabbling sound far overhead. A few flakes of soot dropped down the chimney. Squeak, said the rat, but very quietly. Susan was aware of a new sensation, as a fish might be aware of a new tide, a spring of fresh water flowing into the sea. Time was pouring into the world. She glanced up at the clock. It was just on half-past six. The raven scratched its beak. The rat says... The rat says you'd better watch out. There were others at work on this shining hogswatch eve. The sandman was out and about, dragging his sack from bed to bed. Jack Frost wandered from window pane to window pane, making icy patterns and one tiny hunched shape slid and slivered along the gutter, squelching its feet in slush and swearing under its breath. It wore a stained black suit, and on its head the type of hat known in various parts of the multiverse as Bowler, Darby, or the one that makes you look a bit of a tit. The hat had been pressed down very firmly, and since the creature had long pointy ears, these had been forced out sideways and gave it the look of a small malignant wingnut. The thing was a gnome by shape, but a fairy by profession. Fairies aren't necessarily little twinky creatures. It's purely a job description, and the commonest ones aren't even visible, such as the electric drill-chuck-key fairy. A fairy is simply any creature currently employed under supernatural laws to take things away, or, as in the case of the small creature presently climbing up the inside of a drain pipe and swearing, to bring things. Oh, yes, he does. Someone has to do it, and he looks like the right gnome for the job. Oh, yes. Sidney was worried. He didn't like violence, and there had been a lot of it in the last few days, if days passed in this place. The men, well, they only seemed to find life interesting when they were doing something sharp to someone else, and while they didn't bother him much in the same way that lions don't trouble themselves with ants, they certainly worried him. But not as much as tea time did. Even the brute called Chicken Wire treated tea time with caution, if not respect, and the monster called Banjo just followed him around like a puppy. The enormous man was watching him now. He reminded Sidney too much of Ronnie Jenks, the bully who'd made his life miserable at Gamma Wimblestone's dame school. Ronnie hadn't been a pupil. He was the old woman's grandson or nephew or something, which gave him a license to hang around the place and beat up any kid smaller or weaker or brighter than he was, which more or less meant he had the whole world to choose from. In those circumstances, it was particularly unfair that he always chose Sidney. Sidney hadn't hated Ronnie. He'd been too frightened. He'd wanted to be his friend. Oh, so much. Because that way, just possibly, he wouldn't have had his head trodden on such a lot and would actually get to eat his lunch instead of having it thrown in the privy. And it had been a good day when it had been his lunch. And then, despite all Ronnie's best efforts, Sidney had grown up and gone to university. Occasionally his mother told him how Ronnie was getting on. She assumed in the way of mothers that because they had been small boys at school together they had been friends. Apparently he ran a fruit stall and was married to a girl called Angie, 
who was, according to Sidney's mother, a bit of a catch, since her father owned a half-share in an eel-pie shop in Gleam Street. You must know her. Got all her own teeth and a wooden leg you'd hardly notice. Got a sister called Continence. Lovely girl. Why didn't she invite her along for tea next time he was over? Not that she hardly saw her son, the big wizard at all these days, but you never knew, and if the magic thing didn't work out, then a quarter share in a thriving eel-pie business was not to be sneezed at. This was not enough punishment, Sidney considered. Banjo even breathed like Ronnie, who had to concentrate on such an intellectual exercise and always had one blocked nostril, and his mouth open all the time. He looked as though he was living on an invisible plankton. He tried to keep his mind on what he was doing and ignore the laboured gurgling behind him. A change in its tone made him look up. Fascinating, said Tea Time. You make it look so easy. Sidney sat back nervously. Um, it, it, it should be fine now, sir, he said. It just got a bit scuffed when we were piling up the... Mm. He couldn't bring himself to say it. He even had to avert his eyes from the heap. It was the sound they'd made. The, um, um, things, he finished. We don't need to repeat the spell, said Tea Time. Oh, it'll, it'll, um, it'll keep going forever, said Sidney. The simple ones do. It's, it's just a state change powered by the, the, uh, it just keeps going, he swallowed. So, he said, I was, uh, thinking, since you don't actually, um, Need me, uh, sir, and um, perhaps... Mr. Brown seems to be having some trouble with the locks on the top floor, said Tea Time. That door we couldn't open, remember? I'm sure you'll want to help. Sidney's face fell. Um, I'm, I'm not a, a locksmith. They appear to be magical. Sidney opened his mouth to say, but I'm very bad at magical locks, and then thought much better of it. He had already fathomed that if Tea Time wanted you to do something and you weren't very good at it, then your best plan, in fact, quite possibly your only plan, was to learn to be good at it very quickly. Sidney was not a fool. He'd seen the way the others reacted around Tea Time, and they were men who did things he'd only dreamed of. Not, that is, things he wanted to do, or wanted done to him, just things that he dreamed of, in the armpit of a bad night at which point he was relieved to see Medium Dave walk down the stairs, and it said a lot for the effect of Tea Time's stare that anyone could be relieved to have it punctuated by someone like Medium Dave. We've found another guard, sir, up on the sixth floor. He's been hiding. Tea Time stood up. Oh, dear, he said. Not trying to be heroic, was he? He's just scared. Shall we let him go? Let him go? said Tea Time. Far too messy. I'll go up there. Come along, Mr. Wizard. Sidney followed him reluctantly up the stairs. The tower, if that's what it was, he thought, he was used to the odd architecture at Unseen University, and this made Yu Yu look normal, was a hollow tube. No fewer than four spiral staircases climbed the inside, crisscrossing on landings and occasionally passing through one another in defiance of generally accepted physics. But that was practically normal for an alumnus of Unseen University, although technically Sidney had not alumned. What threw the eye was the absence of shadows. You didn't notice shadows, how they delineated things, how they gave texture to the world, until they weren't there. The white marble, if that's what it was, seemed to glow from the inside. Even when the impossible sun shone through a window, it barely caused faint grey smudges where honest shadows should be. The tower seemed to avoid darkness. That was even more frightening than the times when, after a complicated landing, you found yourself walking up by stepping down the underside of a stair, and the distant floor now hung overhead like a ceiling. He'd noticed that even the other men shut their eyes when that happened. Tea Time, though, took these stairs three at a time, laughing like a kid with a new toy. They reached an upper landing and followed a corridor. The others were gathered by a closed door. He's, um, he's barricaded himself in, said Chicken Wire. Tea Time tapped on it. You in there, he said. Come on out. You have my word you won't be harmed. No. Tea Time stood back. Banjo, knock it down, he said. Banjo lumbered forward. The door withstood a couple of massive kicks and then burst open. The guard was cowering behind an overturned cabinet. He cringed back as Tea Time stepped over it. What are you doing here, he shouted. Who are you? Ah, I'm glad you asked. I'm your worst nightmare, said Tea Time cheerfully. 
The man shuddered. You mean the one with the giant cabbage and the sort of whirring knife thing? Sorry? Tea time looked momentarily nonplussed. Then you're the one about where I'm, I'm falling, only instead of ground underneath, it's all... No, in fact, I'm... The guard sagged. Oh, not the one where there's all this kind of, you know, mud and then everything goes blue and... No, I'm... Oh, shit. Then you're the one where there's this door, only there's no floor beyond it, and then there's these claws and... No, said Tea Time, not that one. He withdrew a dagger from his sleeve. I'm the one where this man comes out of nowhere and kills you stone dead. The guard grinned with relief. Oh, that one, he said, but that one's not very fr... He crumpled around Tea Time's suddenly outthrust fist, and then, just like the others had done, he faded. Rather a charitable act there, I feel, Tea Time said as the man vanished, but it is nearly Hogswatch after all. Death, pillow slipping gently under his red robe, stood in the middle of the nursery carpet. It was an old one. Things ended up in the nursery when they'd seen a complete tour of duty in the rest of the house. Long ago, someone had made it by carefully knotting long bits of brightly coloured rag into a sacking base, giving it the look of a deflated Rastafarian hedgehog. Things lived among the rags. There were old rusks, bits of toy, buckets of dust. It had seen life. It may even have evolved some. Now the occasional lump of grubby, melting snow dropped onto it. Susan was crimson with anger. I mean, why? she demanded, walking around the figure. This is Hog's Watch. It's supposed to be jolly, with mistletoe and holly and, and other things ending in ollie. It's a time when people want to feel good about things and eat until they explode. It's a time when they want to see all their relatives... She stopped that sentence. I mean, it's a time when humans are really human, she said, and they don't want a, 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 a skeleton at the feast. Especially one, I might add, who's wearing a false beard and has got a damp cushion shoved up his robe. I mean, why? Death looked nervous. Albert said it would help me get into the spirit of the thing. Ah... Uh, it's good to see you again. There was a small, squelchy noise. Susan spun round, grateful right now for any distraction. Don't think I can't hear you. They're grapes, understand? And the other things are satsumas. Get out of the fruit bowl. Can't blame a bird for trying, said the raven sulkily from the table. And you, you leave those nuts alone. They're for tomorrow. Squeak! said the Death of Rats, swallowing hurriedly. Susan turned back to death. The Hogfather's artificial stomach was now at groin level. This is a nice house, she said, and this is a good job, and it's real, with normal people, and I was looking forward to a real life where normal things happen, and suddenly the old circus comes to town. Look at yourselves! Three stooges, no waiting. Well, I don't know what's going on, but you can all leave again, right? This is my life. It doesn't belong to any of you. It's not going to... There was a muffled curse, a rush of soot, and a skinny old man landed in the grate. Bum, he said. Good grief, raged Susan. And here is Pixie Albert. Well, well, well. Come along in, do. If the real Hogfather doesn't come soon, there's not going to be a room. He won't be joining us, said Death. The pillow slid softly onto the rug. Oh, and why not? Both of the children did letters to him, said Susan. There's rules, you know. Yes, there are rules, and they're on the list. I checked it. Albert pulled the pointy hat off his head and spat out some soot. Right, he did. Twice, he said. Anything to drink round here? So what have you turned up for? Susan demanded. And if it's for business reasons, I will add, then that outfit is in extremely poor taste. The Hogfather is <clears throat> unavailable. Unavailable? At Hog's Watch? Yes. Why? He is... Let me see. There isn't an entirely appropriate human word, so let's settle for dead. Yes. He is dead. Susan had never hung up a stocking. She'd never looked for eggs laid by the soul-cake duck. 
She'd never put a tooth under her pillow in the serious expectation that a dentally inclined fairy would turn up. It wasn't that her parents didn't believe in such things. They didn't need to believe in them. They knew they existed. They just wished they didn't. Oh, there had been presents at the right time, with a careful label saying who they were from, and a superb egg on soul cake morning, filled with sweets. Juvenile teeth earned no less than a dollar each from her father, without argument, but it was all straightforward. In fact, when she was eight, she'd found a collection of animal skulls in an attic, relic of some former duke of an inquiring turn of mind. Her father had been a bit preoccupied with affairs of state, and she'd made twenty-seven dollars before being found out. The hippopotamus molar had, with hindsight, been a mistake. Skulls never frightened her, even then. She knew now that they'd been trying to protect her. She hadn't known then that her father had been Death's apprentice for a while, and that her mother was Death's adopted daughter. She'd had very dim recollections of being taken a few times to see someone who'd been quite, well, jolly in a strange, thin way, and the visits had suddenly stopped. And she'd met him later, and yes, he had his good side, and for a while she'd wondered why her parents had been so unfeeling, and she knew now why they'd tried to keep her away. There was far more to genetics than little squirmy spirals. She could walk through walls when she really had to. She could use a tone of voice that was more like actions than words, that somehow reached inside people and operated all the right switches. And her hair. That had only happened recently, though. It used to be unmanageable, but at around the age of seventeen, she had found it more or less managed itself. That had lost her several young men. Someone's hair rearranging itself into a new style, the tresses curling around themselves like a nest of kittens, could definitely put the crimp on any relationship. She'd been making good progress, though. She could go for days now without feeling anything other than entirely human. But it was always the case, wasn't it? You could go out into the world, succeed on your own terms, and sooner or later, some embarrassing old relative was bound to turn up. Grunting and swearing, the gnome clambered out of another drain pipe, jammed its hat firmly on its head, threw its sack onto a snowdrift, and jumped down after it. It's a good one, he said. Ah, take him weeks to get rid of that one. He took a crumpled piece of paper out of a pocket and examined it closely. Then he looked at an elderly figure working away quietly at the next house. It was standing by a window, drawing with great concentration on the glass. The gnome wandered up, interested, and watched critically. Why just fern patterns? he said after a while. Pretty, yeah, but you wouldn't catch me putting a penny in your hat for fern patterns. The figure turned, brush in hand. I happen to like fern patterns, said Jack Frost, coldly. It's just that people expect, you know, sad, big-eyed kids, kittens looking out of boots, little doggies, that sort of thing. I do ferns. Or big pots of sunflowers, Happy seaside scenes. And ferns. I mean, supposing some big high priest wanted you to paint the temple ceiling with gods and angels and such like, what did you do then? He could have as many gods and angels as he liked, provided they looked like ferns. I resent the implication that I am solely fern fixated, said Jack Frost. I can also do a very nice paisley pattern. What's that look like, then? Well... It does, admittedly, have a certain ferny quality to the uninitiated eye. Frost leaned forward. Who are you? The gnome took a step backwards. You're not a tooth fairy, are you? I see more and more of them about these days. Mm -hmm. Nice girls. Nah, nah, not teeth, said the gnome, clutching his sack. What then? The gnome told him. Really, said Jack Frost. I thought they just turned up. Well, come to that, I thought frost on the windows just happened all by itself, said the gnome. Yeah, you don't half look spiky. I bet you go through a lot of bed sheets. I don't sleep, said Frost, icily, turning away. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have a large number of windows to do. Ferns aren't easy. You need a steady hand. What do you mean, dead? Susan demanded. How can the hog father be dead? He's... Isn't he what you are? An anthropomorphic personification? Yes, he has become so. The spirit of Hogswatch. But how? How can anyone kill the Hogfather? Poisoned sherry? Spikes in the chimney? There are more subtle ways. 
Cough, 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 cough. Oh, oh dear, this soot, said Albert loudly, chokes me up something cruel. And you've taken over, said Susan, ignoring him. That's sick. Death contrived to look hurt. I'll just go and have a look um, <clears throat> somewhere, said Albert, brushing past her and opening the door. She pushed it shut quickly. And what are you doing here, Albert? she said, clutching at the straw. I thought you'd die if you ever came back to the world. Ah, but we are not in the world, said Death. We are in the special, congruent reality created for the Hogfather. Normal rules have to be suspended. How else could anyone get around the entire world in one night? It's right, said Albert, leering. One of the Hogfather's little helpers, me. Mm. Official, got the pointy green hat and everything. He spotted the glass of sherry and a couple of turnips that the children had left on the table and bore down on them. Susan looked shocked. A couple of days earlier, she'd taken the children to the Hogfather's Grotto in one of the big shops in the mall. Of course, it wasn't the real one, but it had turned out to be a fairly good actor in a red suit. There had been people dressed up as pixies and a picket outside the shop by the Campaign for Equal Heights. The C.E.H. was always ready to fight for the rights of the differently tall, and was not put off by the fact that most pixies and gnomes weren't the least bit interested in dressing up in little pointy hats with bells on when there were other far more interesting things to do. All that tinkly-wee stuff was for the old folks back home in the forest. When a tiny man hit Ankh Morpork, he preferred to get drunk, kick some serious ankle, and search for tiny women. In fact, the C.E.H. now had to spend so much time explaining to people that they hadn't got enough rights that they barely had any time left to fight for them. None of the pixies had looked anything like Albert. If they had, people would have only gone into the grotto armed. "'Been good, have you?' said Albert and spat into the fireplace. Susan stared at him. Death leaned down. She stared up into the blue glow of his eyes. "'You are keeping well?' he said. "'Yes.' Self-reliant, making your own way in the world? Yes. Good. Well, come, Albert, we will load the stockings and get on with things. A couple of letters appeared in Death's hand. Someone christened the child Twyla? I'm afraid so, but what? And the other one, Gawain? Yes, but look how... Why Gawain? I suppose it's a good strong name for a fighter. A self-fulfilling prophecy, I suspect. I see the girl writes in green crayon on pink paper with a mouse in the corner. The mouse is wearing a dress. I ought to point out that she decided to do that so the Hogfather would think she was sweet, said Susan, including the deliberate bad spelling. But look, why are you... She says she is five years old. In years, yes. In cynicism, she's about thirty-five. Why are you doing the... But she believes in the Hogfather? She'd believe in anything if there was a dolly in it for her. But you're not going to leave without telling me... Death hung the stockings back on the mantelpiece. Now we must be going. Happy Hog's Watch. Er... Uh, oh, yes. Ho, ho, ho... "'Nice sherry,' said Albert, wiping his mouth. Rage overtook Susan's curiosity. It had to travel quite fast. "'You've actually been drinking the actual drinks little children leave out for the actual hogfather,' she said. "'Yeah, why not? He ain't drinking them, not where he's gone. "'And how many have you had, may I ask?' "'Jano, <coughs> ain't counted,' said Albert happily. One million, eight hundred thousand, seven hundred and six, said Death, and sixty-eight thousand, three hundred and nineteen pork pies, and one turnip. It looked pork pie-shaped, said Albert. Everything does, after a while. Then why haven't you exploded? Dunno. <laughs> Always had a good digestion. To the Hogfather, all pork pies are as one pork pie, except the one like a turnip. Come, Albert, we have trespassed on Susan's time. Why are you doing this? Susan screamed. I am sorry I cannot tell you. Forget you saw me. It's not your business. Not my business. How can... And now we must be going. Nighty night, said Albert. The clock struck. 
twice for the half hour. It was still half past six, and they were gone. The sledge hurtled across the sky. She'll try to find out what this is all about, you know," said Albert. "Oh dear, especially after you told her not to." "You think so?" "Yeah," said Albert. "Dear me, I still have a lot to learn about humans, don't I?" "Well,、oh, I don't know," said Albert. "Obviously, it would be quite wrong to involve a human in all this. That is why you will recall I clearly forbade her to take an interest." "Yeah, you did." Besides, it's against the rules. You said them little grey buggers had already broken the rules. Yes, but I can't just wave a magic wand and make it all better. There must be procedures. Death stared ahead for a moment and then shrugged. And we have so much to do. We have promises to keep. Well, the night is young," said Albert, sitting back in the sacks. "The night is old. The night." Is always old. The pigs galloped on. Then, no, it ain't. I'm sorry. The night isn't any older than the day, master. Stands to reason. There must have been a day before anyone knew what the night was. Yes, but it's more dramatic. Oh, right then. Susan stood by the fireplace. It wasn't as though she disliked death. Death, considered as an individual rather than life's final curtain, was someone she couldn't help liking in a strange kind of way. Even so, the idea of the grim reaper filling the hog's watch stockings of the world didn't fit well in her head, no matter which way she twisted it. It was like trying to imagine Old Man Trouble as the Tooth Fairy. Oh yes, Old Man Trouble. Now there was a nasty one for you. But honestly, what kind of sick person went around creeping into little children's bedrooms all night? Well. The hog father, of course, but there was a little tinkling sound from somewhere near the base of the hog's watch tree. The raven backed away from the shards of one of the glittering balls. Sorry, it mumbled. Bit of a species reaction there, you know, round, glittering. Sometimes you just got a peck. That chocolate money belongs to the children. Squeak, said the death of rats, backing away from the shiny coins. Why is he doing this? Squeak. You don't know either. Squeak! Is there some kind of trouble? Did he do something to the real hog father? Squeak! Why won't he tell me? Squeak! Thank you. You've been very helpful. Something ripped behind her. She turned and saw the raven carefully removing a strip of red wrapping paper from a package. Stop that this minute! It looked up guiltily. It's only a little bit, it said. No one's going to miss it. What do you want it for anyway? We're attracted to bright colours, right? Automatic reaction. That's jackdaws. Damn, is it? The death of rats nodded. Squeak. Ah, so suddenly you're Mister Ornithologist, are you? Snapped the raven. Susan sat down and held out her hand. The death of rats leapt onto it. She could feel its claws like tiny pins. It was just like those scenes where the sweet and pretty heroine sings a little duet with Mr. Bluebird. Well, similar anyway, in general outline at least, but with more of a PG rating. Has he gone funny in the head? Squeak. The rat shrugged. But it could happen, couldn't it? He's very old, and I suppose he sees a lot of terrible things. Squeak. All the trouble in the world. The raven translated. I understood, said Susan. That was a talent too. She didn't understand what the rat said. She just understood what it meant. There's something wrong, and he won't tell me," said Susan. That made her even more angry. But Albert is in on it too," she added. She thought, thousands, millions of years in the same job. Not a nice one. It isn't always cheerful. Old men passing away at a great age. Sooner or later, it was bound to get anyone down. Someone had to do something. It was like that time when Twyla's grandmother had started telling everyone that she was the Empress of Krull and had stopped wearing clothes. And Susan was bright enough to know that the phrase "someone ought to do something" was not by itself a helpful one. People who used it never added the rider, "And that someone is me." But someone ought to do something, and right now the whole pool of someones consisted of her and no one else. Twyla's grandmother had ended up in a nursing home overlooking the sea at Querm. That sort of option probably didn't apply here. Besides, he'd be unpopular with the other residents. 
She concentrated. This was the simplest talent of them all. She was amazed that other people couldn't do it. She shut her eyes, placed her hands palm down in front of her at shoulder height, spread her fingers and lowered her hands. When they were halfway down, she heard the clock stop ticking. The last tick was long drawn out, like a death rattle. Time stopped, but duration continued. She'd always wondered when she was small why visits to her grandfather could go on for days, and yet when they got back the calendar was still plodding along as if they'd never been away. Now she knew the why, although probably no human being would ever really understand the how. Sometimes, somewhere, somehow, the numbers on the clock did not count. Between every rational moment were a billion irrational ones. Somewhere behind the hours there was a place where the Hogfather rode, the Tooth Fairies climbed their ladders, Jack Frost drew his pictures, the Soul Cake Duck laid her chocolate eggs. In the endless spaces between the clumsy seconds, death moved like a witch dancing through raindrops, never getting wet. Humans could live, no, humans couldn't live here, because even when you diluted a glass of wine with a bath full of water, you might have more liquid, but you still have the same amount of wine. A rubber band was still the same rubber band, no matter how far it was stretched. Humans could exist here, though. It was never too cold, although the air did prickle like winter air on a sunny day. But out of human habit, Susan got her cloak out of the closet. Squeak! Haven't you got some mice and rats to see to, then? Nah, it's pretty quiet just before Hog's Watch, said the raven, who was trying to fold the red paper between his claws. You get a lot of gerbils and hamsters and that in a few days, mind, when the kids forget to feed them or try to find out what makes them go. Of course, she'd be leaving the children, but it wasn't as if anything could happen to them. There wasn't any time for it to happen to them even. She hurried down the stairs and let herself out of the front door. Snow hung in the air. It was not a poetic description. It hovered like the stars. When flakes touched Susan, they melted with little electric flashes. There was a lot of traffic in the street, but it was fossilised in time. She walked carefully between it until she reached the entrance to the park. The snow had done what even wizards and the watch couldn't do, which was clean up Ankh Morpork. It hadn't had time to get dirty. In the morning it had probably looked as though the city had been covered in coffee meringue, but for now it mounded the bushes and trees in pure white. There was no noise. The curtains of snow shut out the city lights. A few yards into the park and she might as well be in the country. She stuck her fingers into her mouth and whistled. You know, that could have been done with a bit more ceremony, said the raven, who'd perched on a snow-encrusted twig. Shut up. It's good, though. Better than most women could do. Shut up. They waited. Why have you stolen that piece of red paper from a little girl's present, said Susan. I've got plans, said the raven darkly. They waited again. She wondered what would happen if it didn't work. She wondered if the rat would snigger. It had the most annoying snigger in the world. Then there were the hoofbeats, and the floating snow burst open, and the horse was there. Binky trotted round in a circle and then stood and steamed. He wasn't saddled. Death's horse didn't let you fall. If I get on, Susan thought, it'll all start again. I'll be out of the light and into the world beyond this one. I'll fall off the tightrope. But a voice inside her said, You want to, though, don't you? Ten seconds later, there was only the snow. The raven turned to the death of rats. Any idea where I can get some string? Squeak. She was watched. One said, Who is she? One said, Do we remember that death adopted a daughter? The young woman is her daughter. One said, She is human. One said, Mostly. One said, Can she be killed? One said, Oh, yes. One said, Well, that's all right, then. One said, Uh, we don't think we're going to get into trouble over this, do we? All this is not exactly authorized. We don't want questions asked. One said, We have a duty to rid the universe of sloppy thinking. One said, Everyone will be grateful when they find out. Binky touched down lightly on Death's lawn. Susan didn't bother with the front door, but went round the back, which was never locked. There had been changes, one significant change at least. 
There was a cat flap in the door. She stared at it. After a second or two, a ginger cat came through the flap, gave her an I'm not hungry and you're not interesting look, and padded off into the gardens. Susan pushed open the door into the kitchen. Cats of every size and colour covered every surface. Hundreds of eyes swivelled to watch her. It was Mrs. Gamage all over again, she thought. The old woman was a regular in beers for the company and was quite gaga, and one of the symptoms of those going completely yo-yo was that they broke out in chronic cats. Usually cats who'd mastered every detail of feline existence except the whereabouts of the dirt box. Several of them had their noses in a bowl of cream. Susan had never been able to see the attraction in cats. They were owned by the kind of people who liked puddings. There were actual people in the world whose idea of heaven would be a chocolate cat. Push off the lot of you, she said. I've never known him have pets. The cats gave her a look to indicate that they were intending to go somewhere else in any case, and strolled off, licking their chops. The bowl slowly filled up again. They were obviously living cats. Only life had colour here. Everything else was created by death. Colour, along with plumbing and music, were arts that escaped the grasp of his genius. She left them in the kitchen and wandered along to the study. There were changes here, too. By the look of it, he'd been trying to learn to play the violin again. He'd never been able to understand why he couldn't play music. The desk was a mess. Books lay open, piled on one another. They were the ones Susan had never learned to read. Some of the characters hovered above the pages or moved in complicated little patterns as they read you while you read them. Intricate devices had been scattered across the top. They looked vaguely navigational, but on what oceans, and under which stars? Several pages of parchment had been filled up with death's own handwriting. It was immediately recognisable. No one else Susan had ever met had handwriting with serifs. It looked as though he'd been trying to work something out. Not Clatch, not a wonderland, not the Empire. Let us say twenty million children at two pounds of toys per child equals seventeen thousand eight hundred and fifty seven tons, one thousand seven hundred and eighty five tons per hour. Memo Don't forget the sooty footprints. More practice on the ho 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 cushion. She put the paper back carefully. Sooner or later it'd get to you. Death was fascinated by humans, and study was never a one way thing. A man might spend his life peering at the private life of elementary particles, and then find he either knew who he was, or where he was, but not both. Death had picked up humanity, not the real thing, but something that might pass for it until you examined it closely. The house even imitated human houses. Death had created a bedroom for himself, despite the fact that he never slept. If he really picked things up from humans, had he tried insanity? It was very popular, after all. Perhaps, after all these millennia, he wanted to be nice. She let herself into the room of lifetimers. She liked the sound of it when she was a little girl, but now the hiss of sand from millions of hourglasses and the little pings and pops as full ones vanished and new empty ones appeared was not so enjoyable. Now she knew what was going on. Of course, everyone died sooner or later. It just wasn't right to be listening to it happening. She was about to leave when she noticed the open door in a place where she had never seen a door before. It was disguised. A whole section of shelving, complete with its whispering glasses, had swung out. Susan pushed it back and forth with a finger. When it was shut, you'd have to look hard to see the crack. There was a much smaller room on the other side. It was merely the size of, say, a cathedral. And it was lined floor to ceiling with more hourglasses that Susan could just see dimly in the light from the big room. She stepped inside and snapped her fingers. Light, she commanded. A couple of candles sprang into life. The hourglasses were wrong. The ones in the main room, however metaphorical they might be, were solid looking things of wood and brass and glass, but these looked as though they were made of highlights and shadows with no real substance at all. She peered at a large one. The name in it was Ofla. The crocodile god, she thought. Well, gods had a life, presumably, but they never actually died, as far as she knew. They just dwindled away to a voice on the wind and a footnote in some textbook on religion. There were other gods lined up. She recognized a few of them. But there were smaller lifetimers on the shelf. When she saw the labels, she nearly burst out laughing.
the Tooth Fairy, the Sandman, John Barleycorn, the Soul Cake Duck, the God of what? She stepped back, and something crunched under her feet. There were shards of glass on the floor. She reached down and picked up the biggest. Only a few letters remained of the name etched into the glass. Hogfa. Oh no! It's true. Granddad, what have you done? When she left, the candles winked out. Darkness sprang back, and in the darkness, among the spilled sand, a faint sizzle and a tiny spark of light. Mustrum Ridcully adjusted the towel around his waist. How are we doing, Mister Modo? The university gardener saluted. The tanks are full, Mister Arch Chancellor, sir. He said brightly, and I've been stoking the hot water boilers all day. The other senior wizards clustered in the doorway. Really, Mustrum, I, I really think this is most unwise," said the lecturer in recent runes. "It was surely sealed up for a purpose." Remember what it said on the door," said the dean. "Oh, they just wrote that on it to keep people out," said Ridcully, opening a fresh bar of soap. "Well, yes," said the chair of indefinite studies. "That's right. That's what people do." It's a bathroom," said Ridcully. "You are all acting as if it's some some kind of a torture chamber." A bathroom," said the dean, "designed by bloody stupid Johnson, Arch Chancellor Weatherwax only used it once and then had it sealed up. Mustrum, I beg you to reconsider. It's a Johnson." There was something of a pause because even Ridcully had to adjust his mind around this. The late, or at least severely delayed, Bergholt Stutley Johnson was generally recognised as the worst inventor in the world, yet in a very specialised sense. Merely bad inventors made things that failed to operate. He wasn't among these small fry. Any fool could make something that did absolutely nothing when you pressed the button. He scorned such fumble-fingered amateurs. Everything he built worked. It just didn't do what it said on the box. If you wanted a small ground-to-air missile, you asked Johnson to design an ornamental fountain. It amounted to pretty much the same thing, but this never discouraged him or the morbid curiosity of his clients. Music, landscape, gardening, architecture—there was no start to his talents. Nevertheless, it was a little bit surprising to find that Bloody Stupid had turned to bathroom design. But as Ridcully said, it was known that he had designed and built several large musical organs, and when you got right down to it, it was all just plumbing, wasn't it? The other wizards, who'd been there longer than the Arch Chancellor, took the view that if Bloody Stupid Johnson had built a fully functional bathroom, he'd actually meant it to be something else. You know, I've always felt that、uh, Mr. Johnson was a much maligned man," said Ridcully eventually. "Well, yes, of course he was," said the lecturer in recent runes, clearly exasperated. "That's like saying that jam attracts wasps, you see." Not everything he made worked badly. Said Ridcully stoutly, flourishing his scrubbing brush. Look at that thing they used down in the kitchens for peeling the potatoes, for example. Ah, you mean the thing with the brass plate on it saying "Improved Manicure Device," Arch Chancellor? Listen, it's 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 just water," snapped Ridcully. Even Johnson couldn't do much harm with water. Modo,、mm, open the sluices. The rest of the wizards backed away as the gardener turned a couple of ornate brass wheels. I'm fed up with groping around for the soap like you fellows," shouted the Arch Chancellor as water gushed through hidden channels. "Hygiene, that's the ticket." "Don't say we didn't warn you," said the Dean, shutting the door. "Ah,、uh, I still haven't worked out where all the pipes lead, sir," Modo ventured. "We'll find out, never you fear," said Ridcully happily. He removed his hat and put on a shower cap of his own design. In deference to his profession, it was pointy. He picked up a yellow rubber duck. Man the pumps, Mister Modo, or or dwarf them, of course. In your case, yes, Arch Chancellor. Modo hauled on a lever. The pipes started a hammering noise, and steam leaked out of a few joints. Ridcully took a last look around the bathroom. It was a hidden treasure, no doubt about it. Say what you like, old Johnson must sometimes have got it right, even if it was only by accident. The entire room, including the floor and ceiling, had been tiled in white, blue, and green. In the centre, under its crown of pipes, was Johnson's patent 
Typhoon, Superior Indoor Ablutorium with Automatic Soap Dish, a sanitary poem in mahogany, rosewood and copper. He'd got Modo to polish every pipe and brass tap until they gleamed. It had taken ages. Ridcully shut the frosted door behind him. The inventor of the ablutionary marvel had decided to make a mere shower a fully controllable experience, and one wall of the large cubicle had a marvellous panel covered with brass taps cast in the shape of mermaids and shells and, for some reason, pomegranates. There were separate feeds for salt water, hard water and soft water, and huge wheels for accurate control of temperature. Ridcully inspected them with care. Then he stood back, looked around at the tiles, and sang, Me, me, me. His voice reverberated back at him. A perfect echo, said Ridcully, one of nature's bathroom baritones. He picked up a speaking tube that had been installed to allow the bather to communicate with the engineer. All systems go, Mr. Modo. Aye, aye, sir. Ridcully opened the tap marked spray, and leapt aside because part of him was still well aware that Johnson's inventiveness didn't just push the edge of the envelope, but often went across the room and out through the wall of the sorting office. A gentle shower of warm water, almost a caressing mist, enveloped him. My word! he exclaimed and tried another tap. Shower turned out to be a little more invigorating. Torrent made him gasp for breath and Deluge sent him groping to the panel because the top of his head felt that it was being removed. Wave sloshed a wall of warm salt water from one side of the cubicle to the other before it disappeared into the grating that was set into the middle of the floor. "'Are you all right, sir?' Modo called out. Marvellous! And there's a dozen knobs I haven't tried yet!' Modo nodded and tapped a valve. Ridcully's voice, raised in what he considered to be song, boomed out through the thick clouds of steam. Oh, I do, um, an agricultural worker of some description, possibly a thatcher, and I knew him well, and he was a farmer, now I come to think of it, and he had a daughter, and her name, I can't recall at the moment, and, and where was I? Ah, yes, chorus, something, 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 a humorously shaped vegetable, a turnip, I believe, something, 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 and a sweet nightingale. Ah! Oh, oh, oh. The song shut off suddenly. All Modo could hear was a ferocious gushing noise. Arch-Chancellor? After a moment, a voice answered from near the ceiling. It sounded somewhat high and hesitant. Uh, I, I, I wonder if you would be so, so very good as to shut the water off from out there, my dear chap. Uh, 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 uh Quite gently, if you wouldn't mind. Modo carefully spun a wheel. The gushing sound gradually subsided. Ah, oh, oh. well done, said the voice, but now from somewhere near a floor level. Well, <clears throat> jolly good job. I think we can definitely call it a success. Yes, indeed. Ah, uh, I wonder if you could help me walk for a moment. I inexplicably feel a little unsteady on my feet. Modo pushed open the door and helped Ridcully out and onto a bench. He looked rather pale. Yes, indeed, said the Arch-Chancellor, his eyes a little glazed. Astoundingly successful. Um, just a minor point, Modo. Yes, sir. There's a tap in there we perhaps should leave alone for now, said Ridcully. I esteem it a service if you could go and make a little sign to hang on it. Yes, sir. Saying, uh, do not touch at all, or something like that. Right, sir. Hang it on the one marked Old Faithful. Yes, sir. No need to mention it to the other fellows, hmm? Yes, sir. Ye gods, I've never felt so clean. From a vantage point among some ornamental tilework near the ceiling, a small gnome in a bowler hat watched Ridcully carefully. When Modo had gone, the Arch-Chancellor slowly began to dry himself on a big fluffy towel. As he got his composure back... So another song wormed its way under his breath. On the second day of Hog's Watch, I sent my true love back a nasty little letter. Oh, yes, indeed, and a partridge in a pear tree. The gnome slid down onto the tiles and crept up behind the briskly shaking shape. 
Rid Cully, after a few more trial runs, settled on a song which evolves somewhere on every planet where there are winters. It's often dragooned into the service of some local religion, and a few words are changed, but it's really about things that have to do with gods only in the same way that roots have to do with leaves. The rising of the sun and the running of the deer. Rid Cully spun. A corner of wet towel caught the gnome on the ear and flicked it onto its back. I saw you creeping up, roared the Arch-Chancellor. What's the game then, eh? Hmm? Small-time thief, are you? The gnome slid backwards on the soapy surface. Yeah, what's your game, mister? You ain't supposed to be able to see me. I'm a wizard. <laughs> we can see things that are really there, you know, said Ridcully. And in the case of the Bertha, things that aren't there, too. What's in this bag? You don't want to open the bag, mister. You really don't want to open the bag. Why, what have you got in it? The gnome sagged. It ain't what's in it, mister. It's what'll come out. I oh, has to let them out, one at a time, no knowing what'd happen if they all gets out at once. Ridcully looked interested and started to undo the string. You'll really wish you hadn't, mister, the gnome pleaded. Will I? <laughs> what are you doing here, young man? The gnome gave up. Well, mm, you know the tooth fairy? Yes, of course, said Ridcully. Well, I ain't her, but it's <clears throat> sort of like... The same business. What, you take things away? Uh, not take away as such, more sort of <clears throat> bring. Ah, like new teeth. Um, like new <clears throat> verrucas, said the gnome. Death threw the sack into the back of the sledge and climbed in after it. You're doing well, master, said Albert. The cushion is still uncomfortable, said Death, hitching his belt. I am not used to a big, fat stomach. Just a stomach's the best I could do, master. You're starting off with a handicap sort of thing. <laughs> Albert unscrewed the top off a bottle of cold tea. All that sherry had made him thirsty. Doing well, master, he repeated, taking a pull. All the soot in the fireplace, the footprints, them swig sherries, the sleigh tracks all over the roofs. It's got to work. You think so? Sure. And I made sure some of them saw me. I know if they are peeping, Death added proudly. Well done, sir. Yes. Oh, here's a tip, though. Just ho, ho, ho will do. Don't say cower brief mortals unless you want them to grow up to be moneylenders or some such. Ho, ho, ho. Yes, you're really getting the hang of it. Albert looked down hurriedly at his notebook so that Death wouldn't see his face. Now, I've got to tell you, Master, what'll really do some good is a public appearance. Really. Oh, I don't normally do them. The Hogfather's more of a public figure, Master, and one good public appearance would do more good than any amount of letting kids see you by accident. Good for the old belief muscles. Really? Ho, ho, ho. Right, right, that's really good, Master. Where was I? Yes, uh, the shops will be open late. Lots of kiddies get taken to see the Hogfather, you see. Not the real one, of course. Just some old geezer with a pillow up his jumper, saving your presence, Master. Not real? Ho, ho, ho. Oh, no. And you don't need... The children know this? Ho, ho, ho. Albert scratched his nose. Uh, suppose so, master. This should not be. No wonder there has been this difficulty. Belief was compromised. Ho, ho, ho. Could be, master. Uh, the ho, ho. Um, Where does this travesty take place? Ho, ho, ho. Albert gave up. Well, Crumley's in the mall, for one. Very popular, the Hogfather Grotto. They always have a good hog father, apparently. Let's get there and slay them. Ho, ho, ho. Right you are, master. That was a pune, or play on words, Albert. I don't know if you noticed. I'm laughing like hell deep down, sir. Ho, 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 ho. 
Arch-Chancellor Ridcully grinned. He often grinned. He was one of those men who grinned even when they were annoyed, but right now he grinned because he was proud. A little sore still, perhaps, but still proud. Amazing bathroom, ain't it? he said. They had it walled up, you know. Damn silly thing to do. I mean, huh, perhaps there were a few teething troubles, he shifted gingerly, but that's only to be expected. It's got everything, you see. Foot baths in the shape of clamshells. Look, hmm. A whole wardrobe for dressing gowns. And that tub over there's got a big blower thingy, so you get bubbly water without even having to eat starchy food. Hmm. And this thingy here with the mermaids holding it up is a special pot for your toenail clippings. Whoa, it's got everything, this place. A special pot for nail clippings, said the Veruca gnome. Oh, can't be too careful, said Ridcully, lifting the lid of an ornate jar marked bath salts and pulling out a bottle of wine. Got hold of something like someone's nail clipping and you've got them under your control. That's the real old magic. Dawn of time stuff. He held the wine bottle up to the light. Should be cooled nicely by now, he said, extracting the cork. Verrucas, eh? Wish I knew why, said the gnome. You mean you don't know? Nope. Suddenly I wake up, and I'm the Veruca gnome. Puzzling that, said Ridcully. My dad used to say the Veruca gnome turned up if you walked around in bare feet. But I never knew you existed. Hmm. I thought he just made it up. I mean, tooth fairies, yes, and them little buggers that live in flowers used to collect them myself as a lad. But can't recall anything about Verrucas, he drank thoughtfully. Got a distant cousin called Veruca, as a matter of fact. It's quite a nice sound when you come to think of it. He looked at the gnome over the top of his glass. You didn't become Arch-Chancellor without a feeling for subtle wrongness in a situation— well, that wasn't quite true. It was more accurate to say that you didn't remain Arch-Chancellor for very long. Good job, is it? he said thoughtfully. Dandruff would be better, said the gnome. At least I'd be out in the fresh air. I think we'd better check up on this, said Ridcully. Of course, it might be nothing. Oh, thank you, said the Veruca gnome gloomily. It was a magnificent grotto this year, Vernon Crumley told himself. The staff had worked really hard. The Hogfather's sleigh was a work of art in itself, and the pigs looked really real, and a wonderful shade of pink. The grotto took up nearly all of the first floor. One of the pixies had been disciplined for smoking behind the magic tinkling waterfall, and the clockwork dolls of all nations, showing how we could all get along, were a bit jerky and giving trouble, but all in all, he told himself... It was a display to delight the hearts of kiddies everywhere. The kiddies were queuing up with their parents and watching the display owlishly. And the money was coming in. Whoa, how the money was coming in. So that the staff would not be tempted, Mr. Crumley had set up an arrangement of overhead wires across the ceilings of the store. In the middle of each floor was a cashier in a little cage. Staff took money from customers put it in a little clockwork cable car, sent it whizzing overhead to the cashier, who'd make change, and start it rattling back again. Thus there was no possibility of temptation, and the little trolleys were shooting back and forth like fireworks. Mr. Crumley loved Hogswatch. It was for the kiddies, after all. He tucked his fingers in the pockets of his waistcoat and beamed. Everything going well, Miss Harding? Yes, Mr. Crumley said the cashier meekly. Jolly good! He looked at the pile of coins. A bright little zigzag crackled off them and earthed itself on the metal grill. Mr. Crumley blinked. In front of him, sparks flashed off the steel rims of Miss Harding's spectacles. The grotto display changed. For just a fraction of a second, Mr. Crumley had the sensation of speed, as though what appeared had screeched to a halt, which was ridiculous. The four pink papier-mâché pigs exploded. A cardboard snout bounced off Mr. Crumley's head. There, sweating and grunting in the place where the little piggies had been, were, well, he assumed they were pigs, because hippopotamuses didn't have pointy ears and rings through their noses, but the creatures were huge and grey and bristly, and a cloud of acrid mist hung over each one. And they didn't look sweet. There was nothing charming about them. One turned to look at him with small red eyes, and didn't go oink, which was the sound that Mr. Crumley, born and raised in the city, had always associated with pinks. It went... <coughs>
The sleigh had changed too. He'd been very pleased with that sleigh. It had delicate silver curly bits on it. He'd personally supervised the gluing on of every twinkling star. But the splendour of it was lying in glittering shards around a sledge that looked as though it had been built of crudely sawn tree trunks laid on two massive wooden runners. It looked ancient, and there were faces carved on the wood, nasty, crude, grinning faces that looked quite out of place. Parents were yelling and trying to pull their children away, but they weren't having much luck. The children were gravitating towards it like flies to jam. Mr. Crumley ran towards the terrible thing, waving his hands. Stop that! Stop that! he screamed. You'll frighten the kiddies! He heard a small boy behind him say, They've got tusks. Cool! His sister said, Hey, look, that one's doing a wee. A tremendous cloud of yellow steam arose. Look, it's going all the way to the stairs. All those who can't swim, hold on to the banisters. They eat you up if you're bad, you know, said a small girl with obvious approval. All up, even the bones. They crunched them. Another, older child, opined, Don't be childish, they're not real. They've just got a wizard in to do the magic. Or it's all done by clockwork. Everyone knows they're not really re One of the boars turned to look at him. The boy moved behind his mother. Mr. Crumley, tears of anger streaming down his face, fought through the milling crowd until he reached the Hogfather's Grotto. He grabbed a frightened pixie. It's the campaign for equal heights that have done this, isn't it? He shouted. They're out to ruin me, and they're ruining it for all the kiddies. Look at the lovely dolls. The pixie hesitated. Children were clustering around the pigs, despite the continued efforts of their mothers. The small girl was giving one of them an orange. But the animated display of dolls of all nations was definitely in trouble. The musical box underneath was still playing, Wouldn't it be nice if everyone was nice? But the rods that animated the figures had got twisted out of shape, so that the Clatchian boy was rhythmically hitting the Omnian girl over the head with his ceremonial spear, while the girl in the Agatean national costume was kicking a small Hlamadosian druid repeatedly in the ear. A chorus of small children was cheering them on indiscriminately. There's, uh, there's more trouble in the grotto, Mr. Crump, the pixie began. A red and white figure pushed its way through the crush and rammed a false beard into Mr. Crumley's hands. That's it, said the old man in the hogfather costume. I don't mind the smell of oranges and the damp trousers, but I ain't putting up with this. He stamped off through the queue. Mr. Crumley heard him add, and he's not even doing it right. Mr. Crumley forced his way onward. Someone was sitting in the big chair. There was a child on his knee. The figure was... strange. It was definitely in something like a hogfather costume, but Mr. Crumley's eye kept slipping. It wouldn't focus. It skittered away and tried to put the figure on the very edge of vision. It was like trying to look at your own ear. What's going on here? What's going on here? Mr. Crumley demanded. A hand took his shoulder firmly. He turned round and looked into the face of a grotto pixie. At least it was wearing the costume of a grotto pixie, although somewhat askew, as if it had been put on in a hurry. Who are you? The pixie took the soggy cigarette end out of its mouth and leered at him. Call me Uncle Heavy, he said. You're not a pixie? Nah. I'm a fairy cobbler, mister. Behind Crumley, a voice said, And what do you want for Hogswatch, small human? Mr. Crumley turned in horror. In front of, well, he had to think of it as the usurping Hogfather, was a small child of indeterminate sex, who seemed to be mostly woolen bobble hat. Mr. Crumley knew how it was supposed to go. It was supposed to go like this. The child was always struck dumb, and the attendant mother would lean forward and catch the hogfather's eye and say very pointedly in that voice adults use when they're conspiring against children, You want a baby tinkler doll, don't you, Doreen? And the just-like-mummy cookery set you've got in the window, and the cut-out kitchen range book, and what do you say? And the stunned child would murmur, Thank you, and get given a balloon or an orange. This time, though, it didn't work like that. Mother got as far as, you want to, why are your hands on bits of string, child? The child looked down the length of its arms to the dangling mittens affixed to its sleeves. It held them up for inspection. Clubs, it said. I see. Very practical. Are you real? said the bobble hat. What do you think? The bobble hat sniggered. I saw your piggy do a wee.
it said, and implicit in the tone was the suggestion that this was unlikely to be dethroned as the most enthralling thing the bobble hat had ever seen. Oh, um, good. It had a great big... What do you want for Hog's Watch? said the Hog Father hurriedly. Mother took her economic cue again and said briskly, She wants a... The Hog Father snapped his fingers impatiently. The mother's mouth slammed shut. The child seemed to sense that here was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and spoke quickly. I want an army, and a big castle with pointy bits, said the child, and a sword. What do you say? prompted the Hog Father. Uh, a big sword? said the child, after a pause for deep cogitation. That's right. Uncle Heavy nudged the Hog Father. They're supposed to say thank you, he said. Are you sure? People don't normally. I meant they thank the Hog Father, Albert hissed, which is you, right? Yes, of course. Ahem. <clears throat> You're supposed to say thank you. Thank you. And be good. This is part of the arrangement. Yes. Then we have a contract. The Hog Father reached into his sack and produced a very large model castle with, as correctly interpreted, pointy blue cone roofs on turrets suitable for princesses to be locked in, a box of several hundred assorted knights and warriors, and a sword. It was four feet long and glinted along the blade. The mother took a deep breath. You can't give her that, she screamed. It's not safe. It's a sword, said the Hogfather. They're not meant to be safe. She's a child, shouted Crumley. It's educational. What if she cuts herself? That will be an important lesson. Uncle Heavy whispered urgently. Oh, really? Oh, well, it's not for me to argue, I suppose. The blade went wooden. And she doesn't want all that other stuff said Doreen's mother, in the face of previous testimony. She's a girl. Anyway, I can't afford big posh stuff like that. I thought I gave it away, said the Hogfather, sounding bewildered. You do? said the mother. You do? said Crumley, who'd been listening in horror. You don't? That's our merchandise. You can't give it away. Hogwatch isn't about giving it all away. Uh, I mean, yes, uh, uh, of course, of course things are given away. He corrected himself, aware that people were watching. But first they have to be bought, do you see? I mean, <laughs> he laughed nervously, increasingly aware of the strangeness around him and the rangy look of Uncle Heavy. It's not as though the toys are made by little elves at the hub. <laughs> Damn right, said Uncle Heavy sagely. You'd have to be a maniac even to think of giving an elf a chisel, less than you want their initials carved on your forehead. You mean... This is all free, said Doreen's mother, sharply, not to be budged from what she saw as the central point. Mr. Crumley looked helplessly at the toys. They certainly didn't look like any of his stock. Then he tried to look hard at the new hogfather. Every cell in his brain was telling him that here was a fat, jolly man in a red and white suit. Well, nearly every cell. A few of the sparkier ones were saying that his eyes were reporting something else, but they couldn't quite agree on what. A couple had shut down completely. The words escaped through his teeth. It seems to be, he said. Although it was Hogswatch, the university buildings were bustling. Wizards didn't go to bed early in any case, and of course there was the Hogswatch night feast to look forward to at midnight. Often they lived to a time scale to suit themselves. Many of the senior ones, of course, lived entirely in the past, but several were like the Professor of Anthropics, who had invented an entire temporal system based on the belief that all the other ones were a mere illusion. Many people are aware of the weak and strong anthropic principles. The weak one says, basically, that it was jolly amazing of the universe to be constructed in such a way that humans could evolve to a point where they make a living in, for example, universities, while the strong one says that, on the contrary, the whole point of the universe was that humans should not only work in universities, but also write for huge sums books with words like cosmic and chaos in the titles. 
the UU Professor of Anthropics, had developed the special and inevitable anthropic principle, which was that the entire reason for the existence of the universe was the eventual evolution of the UU Professor of Anthropics. But this was only a formal statement of the theory which absolutely everyone, with only some minor details of a fill-in-name-here nature, secretly believes to be true. And they're correct. The universe clearly operates for the benefit of humanity. This can be readily seen from the convenient way the sun comes up in the morning when people are ready to start the day. It would give some idea of the scale of the Hogswatch night feast that a light snack at UU consisted of a mere three or four courses, not counting the cheese and nuts. Some of the wizards had been practising for weeks. The dean, in particular, could now lift a twenty-pound turkey on one fork. Having to wait until midnight merely put a healthy edge on appetites already professionally honed. There was a general air of pleasant expectancy about the place, a general sizzling of salivary glands, a general careful assembling of the pills and powders against the time many hours ahead when eighteen courses would gang up somewhere below the ribcage and mount a counterattack. Ridcully stepped out into the snow and turned up his collar. The lights were all on in the high-energy magic building. I don't know, I don't know, he muttered. Hogs watch night and they're still working. It's just not natural. When I was a student, I'd have been sick twice by now. In fact, Ponder Stibbons and his group of research students had made a concession to Hogs watch night. They'd draped holly over hex and put a paper hat on the big glass dome containing the main ant heap. Every time he came in here, it seemed to Ridcully something more had been done to the engine or, or thinking machine or whatever it was. Sometimes stuff turned up overnight. Occasionally, according to Stibbons, Hex himself, um, itself, would draw plans for extra bits that he, it, needed. It all gave Ridcully the willies, and an additional willy was engendered right now when he saw the bursar sitting in front of the thing. For a moment he forgot all about Verrucas. What are you doing here, old chap? he said. You should be inside, jumping up and down to make more room for tonight. There, uh, hooray for the pink, grey and green said the bursar. Er, uh, we thought Hex might be of, you know, help, sir, said Ponder Stibbons, who liked to think of himself as the university's token sane person. With the bursar's problem, we thought it might be a nice hog's watch present for him. Ye gods, bursar's got no problems, said Ridcully, and patted the aimlessly smiling man on the head, while mouthing the words mad as a spoon. Mind just wanders a bit, that's all. I said, mind wanders a bit, hmm? Only to be expected, spends far too much time adding up numbers. Doesn't get out of the fresh air. I said, you don't get out in the fresh air, old chap. We thought, er, uh, he might like someone to talk to, said Ponder. What? What? But I talk to him all the time. I'm always trying to take him out of himself, said Ridcully. It's important to stop him moping around the place. Er, uh, yes, certainly, said Ponder diplomatically. He recalled the bursar as a man whose idea of an exciting time had once been a soft-boiled egg. So, um, well, let's give it another try, shall we? Are you ready, Mr Dinwiddie? Yes, thank you. A green one with cinnamon, if it's not too much trouble. Can't see how he can talk to a machine, said Ridcully in a sullen voice. The thing's got no damn ears. Ah, well, in fact, we made it one ear, said Ponder. Um, he pointed to a large drum in a maze of tubes. Isn't that old Windle Poons's ear trumpet sticking out of the end, said Ridcully suspiciously. Yes, Arch-Chancellor, Ponder cleared his throat. <clears throat> Sound, you see, comes in waves. He stopped. Wizardly premonitions rose in his mind. He just knew Ridcully was going to assume he was talking about the sea. There was going to be one of those huge, bottomless misunderstandings that always occurred whenever anyone tried to explain anything to the Arch-Chancellor. Words like surf and probably ice cream and sand were just... It's all done by magic, Arch-Chancellor, he said, giving up. Ah, right, said Ridcully. He sounded a little disappointed. None of that complicated business with, with the springs and, and cogwheels and tubes and stuff, then? That's right, sir, said Ponder. Just magic. Sufficiently advanced magic. Fair enough. What's it do? 
Hex can hear what you say. Hmm, interesting. Saves all that punching holes in bits of cards and hitting keys you lads are forever doing. Then, what's this, sir? Said Ponder. All right, Adrian. Initialize the GBL. How'd you do that then? Said Red Cully behind him. It means pull the great big lever. Ponder said reluctantly. Ah, takes less time to say. Ponder sighed. Yes, that's right, Arch Chancellor. He nodded to one of the students, who pulled a large red lever marked "Do not pull." Gears spun somewhere inside Hex. Little trap doors opened in the ant farms, and millions of ants began to scurry along the network of glass tubing. Ponder tapped at the huge wooden keyboard. Beats me how you fellows remember how to do all this stuff," <laughs> said Red Cully, still watching him with what Ponder considered to be amused interest. Oh, it's largely intuitive, Arch Chancellor," said Ponder. "Obviously, you have to spend a lot of time learning it first, though.、Uh, now then, Bursa," he added, "if you'd just like to say something." He says, "Say something, Bursa!" yelled Red Cully helpfully into Bursa's ear. Corkscrew, it's a tickler.、Uh, that's what Nanny says," said the Bursa. Things started to spin inside Hex. At the back of the room, a huge converted water wheel covered with sheep skulls began to turn ponderously, and the quill pen in its network of springs and guiding arms started to write. Plus plus plus. Why do you think you are a tickler? Plus plus plus. For a moment, the bursar hesitated. Then he said, "I've got a spoon of my own, you know." Plus plus plus. Tell me about your spoon. Plus plus plus.、Uh, it's a little spoon. Plus plus plus. Does your spoon worry you? Plus plus plus. The bursar frowned. Then he seemed to rally. Whoops! <laughs> Here comes Mister Jelly. He said, but he didn't sound as though his heart was in it. Plus plus plus. How long have you been Mister Jelly? Plus plus plus. The bursar glared. Are you making fun of me? He said. Amazing! Said Red Cully. It got him stumped. It's better than dried frog pills. How'd you work it out? Um," said Ponder. "It sort of just happened." Amazing," said Red Cully. He knocked the ashes out of his pipe on Hex's Ant Hill Inside sticker, causing Ponder to wince. "This thing's a kind of big artificial brain, then." "You could think of it like that," said Ponder carefully. "Of course, Hex doesn't actually think, not as such. It just appears to be thinking." "Ah, like the Dean," said Red Cully. Any chance of fitting a brain like this into the dean's head? It does weigh ten tons, Arch Chancellor. Ah, really? Ooh, hmm. Quite a large crowbar would be in order then. Hmm. He paused and then reached into his pocket. I knew I'd come here for something. He added, "Here, this here chappy is the Veruca gnome." Hello," said the Veruca gnome shyly. Who seems to have popped into existence to be with us here tonight? And you know, I thought this is a bit odd. <laughs> of course, there's always something a bit unreal about Hogswatch Night," said Red Cully. "Last night of the year, and so on. The Hog Father whizzing around, and so forth. Time of the darkest shadows, and so on. All the old years' occult rubbish piling up. Anything could happen. I just thought you fellows might check up on this. Probably nothing to worry about." A Veruca gnome," said Ponder. The gnome clutched his sack protectively. "Makes about as much sense as a lot of things, I suppose," said Red Cully. "After all, there's a tooth fairy, ain't there? You might as well wonder why we have a god of wine and not a god of hangovers." He stopped. "Anyone else hear that noise just then?" he said. "Sorry, Arch Chancellor. Sort of glingalingalingalingaling, like a、uh, tinkly little bells." Didn't hear anything like that, sir. Oh, Red Cully shrugged. Anyway, what was I saying? Ah, yes, yes. No one's ever heard of a Veruca gnome until tonight. That's right," said the gnome. Even I've never heard of me until tonight, and I'm me. We'll see what we can find out, Arch Chancellor," said Ponder diplomatically. Good man," Red Cully put the gnome back in his pocket and looked up at Hex. Amazing," he said again. He just looks as though he's thinking, right? Ah,、uh, yes. But he's not actually thinking. Ah,、uh, no. So he just gives the impression of thinking. Hmm. 
but really it's just a show. Ah, uh, yes. Just like everyone else then, really, said Ridcully. The boy gave the Hogfather an appraising stare as he sat down on the official knee. Let's be absolutely clear. I know you're just someone dressed up, he said. The Hogfather is a biological and temporal impossibility. I hope we understand one another. Ah, so I don't exist. Correct. This is just a bit of seasonal frippery, and I may say rampantly commercial. My mother's already bought my presents. I instructed her as to the right ones, of course. She often gets things wrong. The Hogfather glanced briefly at the smiling, worried image of maternal ineffectiveness hovering nearby. How old are you, boy? The child rolled his eyes. You're not supposed to say that, he said. I have done this before, you know. You have to start by asking me my name. Aaron Fidget, The Pines, Edgeway Road, Ankh Morpork. Uh, I expect someone told you, said Aaron. I expect these people dressed up as pixies get the information from the mothers. And you are eight, going on, oh, about forty-five, said the Hogfather. There's forms to fill in when they pay, I expect, said Aaron. And you want walnuts, inoffensive reptiles of the Stowe Plains, a display cabinet, a collector's album, a killing jar, and a lizard press. What is a lizard press? You can't glue them in when they're still fat, or didn't you know that? I expect she told you about them when I was momentarily distracted by the display of pencils. Look, shall we end this charade? Just give me my orange and we'll say no more about it. I can give far more than oranges. Yes, yes, I saw all that. Probably done in collusion with accomplices to attract gullible customers. Oh dear, you've even got a false beard. By the way, old chap, did you know that your pig... Yes. All done by mirrors and string and pipes, I expect. It all looked very artificial to me. The Hogfather snapped his fingers. That's probably a signal, I expect, said the boy, getting down. Thank you very much. Happy Hogswatch, said the Hogfather, as the boy walked away. Uncle Heavy patted him on the shoulder. Well done, Master, he said. Very patient. I'd have given him a clonk of thwart to the ear hole myself. Oh, I'm sure he'll see the error of his ways. The Red Hood turned so that only Albert could see into its depths. Right around the time he opens those boxes his mother was carrying. Ho, ho, ho. Don't tie it so tight. Don't tie it so tight. Squeak. There was a bickering behind Susan as she sought along the shelves in the canyons of Death's huge library, which was so big that clouds would form in it if they dared. Right, right said the voice she was trying to ignore. That's about right. I've got to be able to move my wings, right? Squeak! Ah, said Susan under her breath, the Hogfather. He had several shelves, not just one book. The first volume seemed to be written on a roll of animal skin. The Hogfather was old. OK, OK. How does it look? Squeak! Miss, said the raven, seeking a second opinion. Susan looked up. The raven bounced past, its breast bright red. Twit, twit, it said. Bobbly, bobbly, bop. Hop, hop, hopping along. You're fooling no one but yourself, said Susan. I can see the string. She unrolled the scroll. Maybe I should sit on a snowy log, mumbled the raven behind her. That's probably the trick right enough. I can't read this said Susan. The letters are all odd. Ethereal runes, said the raven. The hog father ain't human after all. Susan ran her hands over the thin leather. The shapes flowed around her fingers. She couldn't read them, but she could feel them. There was the sharp smell of snow, so vivid that her breath condensed in the air. There were sounds, hooves, the snap of branches in a freezing forest. A bright, shining ball... Susan jerked awake and thrust the scroll aside. She unrolled the next one, which looked as though it was made of strips of bark. Characters hovered over the surface. Whatever they were, they had never been designed to be read by the eye. You could believe they were a braille for the touching mind. Images ribboned across her senses. Wet fur, sweat, pine, soot, iced air, the tang of damp ash, pig shit, manure, her governess mind hastily corrected. There was blood and the taste of beans. It was all images without words, almost animal. 
But none of this is right. Everyone knows he's a jolly old fat man who hands out presents to kids, she said aloud. Is, is, not was. You know how it is, said the raven. Do I? It's like, you know, industrial retraining, said the bird. Even gods have to move with the times, am I right? He was probably quite different thousands of years ago, stands to reason. No one wore stockings, for one thing. He scratched at his beak. Yes, he continued expansively. It was probably just your basic winter demiurge. You know, blood on the snow, making the sun come up. Starts off with animal sacrifice, you know, hunt some big hairy animal to death, that kind of stuff. You know, there's some people up on the ram tops who kill a wren at hog's watch and walk around from house to house singing about it. With a whack follow, diddle diddle do. Very folkloric, very mythic. A wren? Why? I don't know. Maybe someone said, hey! How'd you like to hunt this evil bastard of an eagle with his big sharp beak and great ripping talons sort of thing? Or how about instead you hunt this wren which is basically about the size of a pea and goes twit? Go on, you choose. Anyway, then later on it sinks to the level of religion and then they start this business where some poor bugger finds a special bean in his tucker. Oh, ho, oh, everyone says, you're king, mate, and he thinks, this is a bit of all right, only they don't say it wouldn't be a good idea to start any long books, because next thing he's legging it over the snow with a dozen other buggers, chasing him with holy sickles, so's the earth will come to life again, and all this snow will go away. Very, you know, ethnic. Then some bright spark thought, hey, looks like that damn sun comes up anyway. So how can we give in those druids all this free grub? Next thing you know, there's a job vacancy. That's the thing about gods. They'll always find a way to, you know, hang on. The damn sun comes up anyway, Susan repeated. How do you know that? Ah, oh, observation. Happens every morning. I've seen it. I meant all that stuff about holy sickles and things. The raven contrived to look smug. Very occult bird, you basic raven, he said. Blind Eo, the thunder god, used to have these mythic ravens that flew everywhere and told him everything that was going on. He used to? Well, you know, he's not got eyes in his face. Just these, like, you know, free-floating eyeballs that go and zoom around. The raven coughed in specious embarrassment. Bit of an accident, uh, waiting to happen, really. Do you ever think of anything except eyeballs? Well, there's entrails. Squeak! He's right, though, said Susan. Gods don't die. Never completely die. There's always somewhere, she told herself. Inside some stone, perhaps. Or the words of a song. Or riding the mind of some animal. Or maybe in a whisper on the wind. They never entirely go. They hang on to the world by the tip of a fingernail, always fighting to find a way back. Once a god, always a god. Dead, perhaps, but only like the world in winter. All right, she said. Let's see what happened to him. She reached out for the last book and tried to open it at random. The feeling lashed at her out of the book like a whip. Hooves, fear, blood, snow, cold, night. She dropped the scroll. It slammed shut. Squeak? I'm all right. He looked down at the book and knew that she'd been given a friendly warning, such as a pet animal might give when it was crazed with pain, but just still tame enough not to claw and bite the hand that fed it this time. Wherever the hogfather was, dead, alive, somewhere, he wanted to be left alone. She eyed the death of rats. His little sockets flared blue in a disconcertingly familiar way. Squeak, meek! The rat says if he wanted to find out about the hogfather, he'd go to the Castle of Bones. Oh, that's just a nursery tale, said Susan. That's where the letters are supposed to go that are posted up the chimney. That's just an old story. She turned. The rat and the raven were staring at her, and she realised that she'd been too normal. Squeak! The rat says, What do you mean, just? said the raven. Chicken wire sidled towards Medium Dave in the garden, if you could call it a garden. It was the land around the house, if you could call it a house. No one said much about it, but every so often you just had to get out. 
It didn't feel right inside. He shivered. Uh, uh, where's himself? he said. Oh, up at the top, said Medium Dave, still trying to open that room. The, uh, the one with all the locks? Yeah. Medium Dave was rolling a cigarette. Inside the house, or tower, or both, or whatever, you couldn't smoke, not properly. When you smoked inside, it tasted horrible and you felt sick. Uh, what for? We done what we came to do, didn't we? <laughs> Stood there like a bunch of kids and watched that wet wizard do all his chanting. It was all I could do to keep a straight face. <laughs> What's he after now? He just said if it was locked that bad, he wanted to see inside. I thought we were supposed to <laughs> to do what we came for and, and, and go. Yeah, you tell him. Want to roll up? Chicken Wire took the bag of tobacco and relaxed. Ooh, I've seen some bad places in my time, but this takes the serious biscuit. Yeah. It's the cute that wears you down, and there's got to be something else to eat than apples. Yeah. And that damn sky, that damn sky is really getting on my nerves. Yeah. They kept their eyes averted from that damn sky. For some reason, it made you feel that it was about to fall on you. And it was worse if you let your eyes stray to the gap where a gap shouldn't be. The effect was like getting a toothache in your eyeballs. In the distance, Banjo was swinging on a swing. Odd that, Dave thought. Banjo seemed perfectly happy here. He found a tree that grows lollipops yesterday, he said moodily. Well, I say yesterday, but how can you tell? And he follows the man around like a dog. No one ever laid a punch on Banjo since our man died. He's just like a little boy, you know, inside. Always has been. Looks to me for everything. Used to be, if I told him, punch someone, he'd do it. And they stay punched. Yeah. Now he follows him around everywhere. It makes me sick. What are you doing here, then? Ten thousand dollars. And he says there's more, you know, more than we can imagine. He was always tea time. He ain't just after money. Yeah, well, I didn't sign up for world domination, said Medium Dave. That sort of thing gets you into trouble. I remember your ma'am saying that sort of thing, said Chicken Wire. Medium Dave rolled his eyes. Everyone remembered Ma Lillywhite. Very straight lady was your Ma. Hm. Tough, but fair. Yeah, tough. I recall that time she uh, she strangled Glossy Ron with his own leg. Chicken Wire went on. She had a wicked right arm on her, your man. Yeah, wicked. She wouldn't have stood for someone like tea time. Yeah, said Medium Dave. That was a lovely funeral you boys gave her. Most of the shades turned up. Hm. Very respectful, all them flowers, and everyone looking so... Chicken Wire floundered. Happy? Uh, in a sad way, of course. Yeah. You got any idea how to get back home? Medium Dave shook his head. Hmm. Me, uh, me neither. <laughs> Find the place again, I suppose? Chicken Wire shivered. I mean, <laughs> what he did to that carter, I mean, well, I wouldn't even act like that to me own dad. Yeah. Ordinary mental, yeah. <laughs> I can deal with that, but he can be talking quite normal. And then, yeah. Maybe the both of us could creep up on him and, uh, yeah, yeah. And how long will we live? In seconds. We could get lucky, Chicken Wire began. Yeah, you've seen him. This isn't one of those blokes who threatens you. This is one of those blokes who'd kill you as soon as look at you. Easier, too. We've got to hang on, right? It's like that saying about riding a tiger. Uh, what saying about riding a tiger? said Chicken Wire suspiciously. Well, Medium Dave hesitated. Yeah, well, you get branches slapping you in the face. Fleas, that sort of thing. So you got to hang on. Think of the money. There's bags of it in there. You saw it. I keep thinking of that glass eye <laughs> watching me. <laughs> I keep thinking it can see right in my head. Don't worry, he doesn't suspect you of anything. How do you know? You're still alive, yeah? In the grotto of the Hogfather, a round-eyed child. Happy Hog's Watch, ho, ho, ho. And your name is Euphrasia Goat, correct? Go on, dear, answer the nice man. Yes. And you are six years old. Go on, dear. They're all the same at this age, aren't they? Yes. And you want a pony? Yes. A small hand pulled the hogfather's hood down to mouth level. 
Heavy Uncle Albert heard a ferocious whispering. Then the Hogfather leaned back. Yes, I know. What a naughty pig it was indeed. His shape flickered for a moment, and then a hand went into the sack. Here is a bridle for your pony, and a saddle, and a rather strange hard hat, and a pair of those trousers that make you look as though you have a large rabbit in each pocket. But we can't have a pony, can we, Yuffie? Because we live on the third floor. Oh, yes, it's in the kitchen. I'm sure you're making a little joke, Hogfather, said Mother sharply. Ho, ho, yes, what a jolly fat man I am. In the kitchen? What a joke. Dollies and so on will be delivered later as per your letter. What do you say, Yuffie? Thank you. Here, you didn't really put a pony in their kitchen, did you? said heavy Uncle Albert as the line moved on. Don't be foolish, Albert. I said that to be jolly. Oh, right. <laughs> For a minute. It's in the bedroom. Ah,、oh, more hygienic. Well, it'll make sure of one thing, said Albert. Third floor. They're going to believe all right. Yes. You know, I think I'm getting the hang of this. Ho, ho, ho. At the hub of the disc world, the snow burned blue and green. The aurora corialis hung in the sky, curtains of pale cold fire that circled the central mountains and cast their spectral light over the ice. They billowed, swirled, and then trailed a ragged arm on the end of which was a tiny dot that became, when the eye of imagination drew nearer, Binky. He trotted to a halt and stood on the air. Susan looked down and then found what she was looking for. At the end of a valley of snow mounded trees, something gleamed brightly, reflecting the sky. The Castle of Bones. Her parents had sat her down one day when she was about six or seven and explained how such things as the Hogfather did not really exist, how they were pleasant little stories that it was fun to know, how they were not real, and she had believed it. All the fairies and bogeymen, all those stories from the blood and bone of humanity, were not really real. They'd lied. A seven foot skeleton had turned out to be her grandfather. Not a flesh and blood grandfather, obviously, but a grandfather, you could say, in the bone. Binky touched down and trotted over the snow. Was the hog father a god? Why not? thought Susan. There were sacrifices, after all. All that sherry and pork pie. And he made commandments and rewarded the good, and he knew what you were doing. If you believed, nice things happened to you. Sometimes you found him in a grotto, and sometimes he was up there in the sky. The Castle of Bones loomed over her now. It certainly deserved the capital letters, up this close. She'd seen a picture of it in one of the children's books. Despite its name, the woodcut artist had endeavoured to make it look sort of jolly. It wasn't jolly. The pillars at the entrance were hundreds of feet high. Each of the steps leading up was taller than a man. They were the grey green of old ice. Ice! Not bone. There were faintly familiar shapes to the pillars, possibly a suggestion of femur or skull, but it was made of ice. Binky was not challenged by the high stairs. It wasn't that he flew, it was simply that he walked on a ground level of his own devising. Snow had blown over the ice. Susan looked down at the drifts. Death left no tracks, but there were the faint outlines of booted footprints. She'd be prepared to bet they belonged to Albert. And, yes, half obscured by the snow, it looked as though a sledge had stood there. Animals had milled around, but the snow was covering everything. She dismounted. This was certainly the place described, but it still wasn't right. It was supposed to be a blaze of light and a buzz with activity, but it looked like a giant mausoleum. A little way beyond the pillars was a very large slab of ice cracked into pieces. Far above, stars were visible through the hole it had left in the roof. Even as she stared up, a few small lumps of ice thumped into a snowdrift. The raven popped into existence and fluttered wearily onto a stump of ice beside her. This place is a morgue, said Susan. It's going to be mine if I do any more flying tonight, panted the raven as the death of rats got off its back. I never sign up for all this long distance, faster in time stuff. I should be back in a forest somewhere making excitingly decorated constructions to attract females. That's bower birds, said Susan. Ravens don't do that. Oh, so it's typecasting now, is it? said the raven. 
I'm missing meals here. You do know that. It swiveled its independently sprung eyes. So, where's all the lights? It said. Where's all the noise? Where's all the jolly little buggers in pointy hats and red and green suits hitting wooden toys unconvincingly yet rhythmically with hammers? This is more like the temple of some old thunder god," said Susan. "Squeak! No, I read the map right. Anyway, Albert's been here too. There's fag ash all over the place." The rat jumped down and walked around for a moment, bony snout near the ground. After a few moments of snuffling, it gave a squeak and hurried off into the gloom. Susan followed. As her eyes grew more accustomed to the faint blue-green light, she made out something rising out of the floor. It was a pyramid of steps with a big chair on top. Behind her, a pillar groaned and twisted slightly. Squeak! That rat says this place reminds him of some old mine," said the Raven. "You know, after it's been deserted and no one's been paying any attention to the roof supports and so on,、mm, we see a lot of them. At least these steps were human-sized," Susan thought, ignoring the chatter. Snow had come in through another gap in the roof. Albert's footprints had stamped around quite a lot here. Maybe the old hog father crashed his sleigh. The raven suggested. Squeak. Well, it could have happened. Pigs are not notably aerodynamic, are they? And with all this snow, you know, poor visibility. Big cloud ahead turns out too late to be a mountain. There's buggers in saffron robes looking down at you. Poor devil tries to remember whether you're supposed to shove someone's head between your legs. Then wham, and it's all over, bar some lucky mountaineers making an awful lot of sausages and finding the flight recorder. Squeak. Yes, but he's an old man. Probably shouldn't be in the sky at his time of life. Susan pulled at something half buried in the snow. It was a red and white striped candy cane. She kicked the snow aside elsewhere and found a wooden toy soldier in the kind of uniform that would only be inconspicuous if you wore it in a nightclub for chameleons on hard drugs. Some further probing found a broken trumpet. There was some more groaning in the darkness. The raven cleared its throat. Ugh, what the rat meant about this place being like a mine, he said, was that abandoned mines tend to creak and groan in the same way. See. No one looking after the pit props. Things fall in. Next thing you know, you're a squiggle in the sandstone. We shouldn't hang around, is what I'm saying. Susan walked further in, lost in thought. This was all wrong. The place looked as though it had been deserted for years, which couldn't be true. The column nearest her creaked and twisted slightly. A fine haze of ice crystals dropped from the roof. Of course, this wasn't exactly a normal place. You couldn't build an ice palace this big. It was a bit like Death's house. If he abandoned it for too long, all those things that had been suspended, like time and physics, would roll over it. It would be like a dam bursting. She turned to leave and heard the groan again. It wasn't dissimilar to the tortured sounds being made by the ice, except that ice afterwards didn't moan. Oh me! There was a figure lying in a snowdrift. She'd almost missed it because it was wearing a long white robe. It was spread-eagled as though it had planned to make snow angels, and had then decided against it. And it wore a little crown, apparently of vine leaves, and it kept groaning. She looked up. The roof was open here too, but no one could have fallen that far and survived. No one human, anyway. He looked human, and in theory quite young, but it was only in theory. Because even by the second-hand light of the glowing snow, his face looked like someone had been sick with it. Are you all right? She ventured. The recumbent figure opened its eyes and stared straight up. Ah,、oh, I wish I was dead. It moaned. A piece of ice the size of a house fell down in the far depths of the building and exploded in a shower of sharp little shards. You may have come to the right place," said Susan. She grabbed the boy under his arms and hauled him out of the snow. I think leaving would be a very good idea around now, don't you? This place is going to fall apart. Oh me! She managed to get one of his arms around her neck. Can you walk? Oh me! It might help if you stopped saying that and tried walking. I'm sorry, but I seem to have too many legs. Ow! Susan did her best to prop him up as, swaying and slipping, they made their way back to the exit. My head," 
said the boy. My head! My head! My head feels awful! My head feels like someone's hitting it! My head with a hammer! Someone was. There was a small green and purple imp sitting amid the damp curls and holding a very large mallet. It gave Susan a friendly nod and brought the hammer down again. Oh, me! That wasn't necessary, said Susan. You telling me my job, said the imp. I suppose you could do it better, could you? I wouldn't do it at all. Well, someone's got to do it, said the imp. He's part of the arrangement, said the boy. Yeah, see, said the imp. Can you hold the hammer while I go and coat his tongue with yellow gunk? Get down right now. Susan made a grab for the creature. It leapt away, still clutching the hammer, and grabbed a pillar. I'm part of the arrangement, I am, it yelled. The boy clutched his head. Oh, I feel awful, he said. Have you got any ice? Whereupon, because there are conventions stronger than mere physics, the building fell in. The collapse of the Castle of Bones was stately and impressive and seemed to go on for a long time. Pillars fell in, the slabs of the roof slid down, the ice crackled and splintered, the air above the tumbling wreckage filled with a haze of snow and ice crystals. Susan watched from the trees. The boy, who she'd leaned against a handy trunk, opened his eyes. Oh, that was amazing, he managed. Why, you mean the way it's all turning back into snow? The way you just picked me up and ran. Ouch! Oh, that! The grinding of the ice continued. The fallen pillars didn't stop moving when they collapsed, but went on tearing themselves apart. When the fog of ice settled, there was nothing but drifted snow. As though it was never there, said Susan aloud. She turned to the groaning figure. All right, what were you doing there? I don't know. I just opened my eyes and there I was. Who are you? I think my name is uh, Bilius. I'm the, uh, I'm, uh, the, oh, I'm the, oh, God, of hangovers. There's a God of hangovers? An, oh, God, he corrected. When people witness me, you see, they clutch their head and say, oh, God. How many of you are standing here? What? There's just me. Oh, fine, fine. I've never heard of a god of hangovers. You've heard of Bibulus, the god of wine? Ah, oh, ouch! Oh, yes. Big, fat man wears vine leaves round his head, always pictured with a glass in his hand. Ow! Oh. Well, you know why he's so cheerful? Him and his big face? It's because he knows he's going to feel good in the morning. It's because it's me that gets the hangovers, said Susan. I don't even drink. Ah! But who is it who ends up head down in the privy every morning? Oh, God. He stopped and clutched at his head. Should your skull feel like it's lined with dog hair? I don't think so. Ah! Bilius swayed. You know when people say, I had fifteen lagers last night and when I woke up my head was clear as a bell? Oh, yes. Bastards! That's because I was the one who woke up groaning in a pile of recycled chili. Just once, I, I mean just once, I'd like to open my eyes in the morning without my head sticking to something. He paused. Are there any giraffes in this wood? Up here, I shouldn't think so. He looked nervously past Susan's head. Not even indigo-coloured ones which are sort of stretched and keep Flashing on and off? Very unlikely. Thank goodness for that. He swayed back and forth. Excuse me, I think I'm about to throw up my breakfast. It's the middle of the evening. Is it? In that case, I think I'm about to throw up my dinner. He folded up gently in the snow behind the tree. He's a long streak of whittle, isn't he? Said a voice from a branch. It was the raven. Got a neck? with a knee in it. The O oh God reappeared after a noisy interlude. I know I must eat, he mumbled. It's just that the only time I remember seeing my food 
It's always going the other way. What were you doing in there? said Susan. Ouch! Oh, search me, said the O-God. It's only a mercy I wasn't holding a, a traffic sign and wearing a... He winced and paused. Having some kind of woman's underwear about my person. He sighed. Someone, somewhere, has a lot of fun, he said wistfully. I wish it was me. Get a drink inside you, that's my advice, said the raven. Have a hair of the dog that bit someone else. But why there? Susan insisted. The old god stopped trying to glare at the raven. I don't know. Where was there, exactly? Susan looked back at where the castle had been. It was entirely gone. There was a very important building there a moment ago, she said. The old god nodded carefully. I... Often see things that weren't there a moment ago, he said, and they often aren't there a moment later, which is a blessing in, in most cases, let me tell you, so I don't usually take a lot of notice. He folded up and landed in the snow again. There's just snow now, Susan thought, nothing but snow and the wind. There's not even a ruin. The certainty stole over her again that the Hogfather's castle wasn't simply not there any more. No, it had never been there. There was no ruin, no trace. It had been an odd enough place. It was where the Hogfather lived, according to the legends, which was odd when you thought about it. It didn't look like the kind of place a cheery old toy maker would live in. The wind soft in the trees behind them. Snow slid off the branches. Somewhere in the dark there was a flurry of hooves. A spidery little figure leapt off a snowdrift and landed on the O-God's head. It turned a beady eye up towards Susan. All right by you, is it? said the imp, producing its huge hammer. Some of us have a job to do, you know, even if we are of a metaphorical, nay, a folkloric persuasion. Oh, go away! If you think I'm bad, wait till you see the little pink elephants, said the imp. I don't believe you. They come out of his ears and fly around his head, making tweeting noises. Ah, said the raven sagely, that sounds more like robins. I wouldn't put anything past them. The O-God grunted. Susan suddenly felt that she didn't want to leave him. He was human. Well, human-shaped. Well, at least he had two arms and legs. He'd freeze to death here. Of course, gods, or even O-gods, probably couldn't, but humans didn't think like that. You couldn't just leave someone. She prided herself on this bit of normal thinking. Besides, he might have some answers, if she could make him stay awake enough to understand the questions. From the edge of the frozen forest... Animal eyes watched them go. Mr. Crumley sat on the damp stairs and sobbed. He couldn't get any nearer to the toy department. Every time he tried, he got lifted off his feet by the mob and dumped at the edge of the crowd by the current of people. Someone said, Top of the evening, squire. And he looked up, blearily, at the small yet irregularly formed figure that had addressed him thusly. Are you one of the pixies? he said, after mentally exhausting all the other possibilities. No, sir. I am not, in fact, a pixie, sir. I am, in fact, Corporal Nobbs of the Watch, and this is Constable Visit, sir. The creature looked at a piece of paper in its paw. You, Mr. Crummy? Crumley? Yeah, right. You sent a runner to the watch house, and we have hereby responded with commendable speed, sir, said Corporal Nobbs. Despite its being Hogswatch night and there being a lot of strange things happening, and most importantly, it being the occasion of our Hogswatchly piss up, sir. But this is all right because Washpot, that's Constable Visit here, he doesn't drink, sir, it being against his religion. And although I do drink, sir, I volunteered to come because it is my civic duty, sir. Nobby tore off a salute, or what he likes to believe was a salute. He did not add, and turning out for a rich bugger such as your good self is bound to put the officer concerned in the way of a seasonal bottle or two of some other tangible evidence of gratitude, because his entire stance said it for him. Even Nobby's ears could look suggestive. Unfortunately, Mr. Crumley wasn't in the right receptive frame of mind. He stood up and waved a shaking finger towards the top of the stairs. I, I want you to go up there, he said, and arrest him. Arrest who, sir? said Corporal Nobbs. The hog father. What for, sir? Because he's sitting up there as bold as brass in his grotto, giving away presents. Corporal Nobbs thought about this. 
You've been having a festive drink, have you, sir? He said hopefully. I do not drink. Very wise, sir, said Constable Visit. Alcohol is the tarnish of the soul. Ossery, Book Two, Verse Twenty Four. Not quite up to speed here, sir," said Corporal Nobbs, looking perplexed. "I thought the Hogfather is supposed to give away stuff, any?" This time, Mister Crumley had to stop and think. Up until now, he hadn't quite sorted things out in his head, other than recognizing their essential wrongness. "This one is an impostor," he declared. "Yes, that's right. He smashed his way into here." "You know, I always thought that," said Nobby. "I thought every year." The Hogfather spends a fortnight sitting in a wooden grotto in his shop in Ark Moorpork, and his busy time too. <laughs> not likely. Probably just some old man in a beard. I thought. I meant he's not the Hogfather we usually have," said Crumley, struggling for firmer ground. He just barged in here. Oh, a different impostor. Not the real impostor at all. Well, yes,、uh, no, and started giving stuff away. Said Corporal Nobbs. That's what I said. That's got to be a crime, hasn't it? Corporal Nobbs rubbed his nose. Well, nearly, he conceded, not wishing to totally relinquish the chance of any festive remuneration. Realization dawned. He's given away your stuff, sir. No, no. He he brought it in with him. Huh? Given away your stuff now? If he was doing that, yes, I could see the problem. That's a sure sign of crime. Stuff going missing. Stuff turning up, woo! That's a tricky one. Unless it's stuff like arms and legs, of course. We'd be on safer ground if he was nicking stuff, sir. To tell you the truth, this is a shop," said Mister Crumley, finally getting to the root of the problem. We do not give merchandise away. How can we expect people to buy things if some person is giving them away? Now, please go and get him out of here. Arrest the Hogfather style of thing. Yes, on Hogswatch night. Yes, in your shop. Yes, in front of all those kiddies. Ye. Mister Crumley hesitated. To his horror, he realised that Corporal Nobbs, against all expectation, had a point. You think that will look bad? He said. Hard to see how it could look good, sir. Could you not do it surreptitiously? He said. Ah,、oh, well. Surreptition. Yes, we could give that a try," said Corporal Nobbs. The sentence hung in the air with its hand out. "You won't find me ungrateful," said Mister Crumley at last. "Just you leave it to us," said Corporal Nobbs, magnanimous in victory. "You just nip down to your office and treat yourself to a nice cup of tea, and we'll sort this out in no time. You'll be ever so grateful." Crumley gave him a look of a man in the grip of serious doubt, but staggered away nonetheless. Corporal Nobbs rubbed his hands together. "You don't have Ogg's watch back where you come from, do you, Washpot?" he said as they climbed the stairs to the first floor. "Look at this carpet. You'd think a pig had pissed on it." "We call it the Fast of Saint Ossery," said Visit, who was from Omnia. "But it is not an occasion for superstition and crass commercialism. We simply get together in family groups for a prayer meeting and a fast." "What?" Turkey and chicken and that, a fast, Corporal Nobbs. We don't eat anything. Oh, right. Well, each to his own, I suppose. And at least you don't have to get up early in the morning and find that the nothing you've got is too big to fit in the oven. No presents neither. They stood aside hurriedly as two children scuttled down the stairs, carrying a large toy boat between them. It is sometimes appropriate to exchange new religious pamphlets, and of course there are usually copies of the Book of Ossery for the children," said Constable Visit. Sometimes with illustrations," he added, in the guarded way of a man hinting at licentious pleasures. A small girl went past carrying a teddy bear larger than herself. It was pink. They always gives me bath salts," complained Nobby, "and bath soap and bubble bath and." Herbal bath lumps and tons of bath stuff, and I can't think why, because it's not as if I hardly ever has a bath. You'd think they'd take the hint, wouldn't you? Abominable, I call it," said Constable Visit. The first floor was a mob. Eh, look at them. Mister Hogfather never brought me anything when I was a kid," said Corporal Nobbs, eyeing the children gloomily. "I used to hang up my stocking every Ogg's Watch regular. All that ever happened was my dad was sick in it once." He removed his helmet. Nobby was not by any measure a hero, 
but there was the sudden gleam in his eye of someone who'd seen altogether too many empty stockings plus one rather full and dripping one. A scab had been knocked off some wound in the corrugated little organ of his soul. I'm going in, he said. In between the university's great hall and its main door is a rather smaller circular hall, or vestibule, known as Arch-Chancellor Bowell's Remembrance, although no one knows why, or why an extant bequest pays for one small current bun and one copper penny to be placed on a high stone shelf on one wall every second Wednesday. The ceremony still carries on, of course. If you left off traditions because you didn't know why they'd started, you'd be no better than a foreigner. Ridcully stood in the middle of the floor, looking upwards. Tell me, mm, senior wrangler, we never invited any women to Hogswatch Night Feast, did we? Of course not, Arch-Chancellor, said the senior wrangler. He looked up in the dust-covered rafters, wondering what had caught Ridcully's eye. Good heavens, no, they'd spoil everything. I've always said so. And all the uh, maids have got the evening off until midnight? A very generous custom, I've always said said the senior wrangler, feeling his neck crick. So why every year do we hang a damn great bunch of mistletoe up there? The senior wrangler turned in a circle, still staring upwards. Well, uh, it's, um, well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's symbolic, Arch-Chancellor. Huh? The senior wrangler felt that something more was expected. He groped around in the dusty attics of his education. Of the the leaves, you see, they're they're symbolic of 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 green, you see. Whereas the berries, in fact, yes, yes, the berries symbolise symbolise mm, white, yes, white and green. Mm. Very symbolic. He waited. He was not unfortunately disappointed. What of? The senior wrangler coughed. <clears throat> I'm not sure that there has to be an of. He said. Ah, so said the Arch-Chancellor thoughtfully. It could be said that the white and green symbolise a small parasitic plant. Yes, indeed, said the senior wrangler. So mistletoe, in fact, symbolises mistletoe. Exactly, Arch-Chancellor, said the senior wrangler, who was now just hanging on. Funny thing, that, said Ridcully, in the same thoughtful tone of voice. That statement is either so deep it would take a lifetime to fully comprehend every particle of its meaning, or it is a load of absolute tosh. Which is it, I wonder? It could be both, said the senior wrangler desperately. And that comment, said Ridcully, is either very perceptive or very trite. It might be both. Don't push it, senior wrangler. There was a hammering on the outer door. Ah, that'll be the Wassellers," said the senior wrangler, happy for the distraction. They call on us first every year. I personally have always liked the lily-white boys, you know. The arch-chancellor glanced up at the mistletoe, gave the beaming man a sharp look, and opened the little hatch in the door. Well now, wassailing you fellows, he began. Oh well, I must say, you might have picked a better time. A hooded figure stepped through the wood of the door, carrying a limp bundle over its shoulder. The senior wrangler stepped backwards quickly. Oh, no, not tonight. And then he noticed that what he had taken for a robe had lace around the bottom, and the hood, while quite definitely a hood, was nevertheless rather more stylish than the one he had first mistaken it for. Putting down or taking away, said Ridcully. Susan pushed back her hood. I need your help, Mr. Ridcully, she said. Your... Aren't you Death's granddaughter? said Ridcully. Didn't I meet you a few... Yes sighed Susan. And, um, are you helping out? said Ridcully. His waggling eyebrows indicated the slumbering figure over her shoulder. I need you to wake him up, said Susan. Some sort of, uh, miracle, you mean, said the senior wrangler, who was a little behind. He's not dead, said Susan. He's just resting. That's what they all say, the senior wrangler quavered. Ridcully, who was somewhat more practical, lifted the O-God's head. There was a groan. Looks a bit, uh, under the weather, he said. He's the god of hangovers, said Susan. The O-god of hangovers. Really, said Ridcully. Never had one of those myself. Funny thing, I can drink all night and feel as fresh as a daisy in the morning. The O-god's eyes opened. Then he soared towards Ridcully and started beating him on the chest with both fists. You utter, utter bastard. I hate you. 
I hate you, hate you, hate you. His eyes shut, and he slid down to the floor. What was all that about? said Ridcully. I think it was some kind of nervous reaction, said Susan diplomatically. Something nasty's happened tonight. I'm hoping he can tell me what it is, but he's got to be able to think straight first. Hmm, and you brought him here, said Ridcully. Ho, ho, ho! Yes, indeed, hello, small child called Veruca Lumpy. What a lovely name, aged seven, I believe, good. Yes, I know it did, all over the nice clean floor, yes. They do, you know, that's one of the things about real pigs. Here we are, don't mention it. Happy hogs watch and be good. I will know if you're good or bad, you know. Ho, ho, ho! Well, you brought some magic into that little life said Albert, as the next child was hurried away. "'It's the expression on their little faces I like,' said the hog-father. "'You mean, sort of, fear and awe and not knowing whether to laugh or cry or wet their pants?' "'Yes. Now that is what I call belief.' The O God was carried into the great hall and laid out on a bench. The senior wizards gathered round, ready to help those less fortunate than themselves remain that way. "'I know what's good for a hangover,' said the dean, who was feeling in a party mood. They looked at him expectantly. "'Drinking heavily the previous night,' he said. He beamed at them. "'That was a good word joke,' he said, to break the silence. The silence came back. "'Most amusing,' said Ridcully. He turned back and stared thoughtfully at the O-God. "'Raw eggs are said to be good,' he glared at the dean. "'I mean, bad for a hangover,' he said. "'And fresh orange juice.' Clatchian coffee, said the lecturer in recent runes, firmly. But this fellow hasn't just got his hangover, he's got everyone's hangover, said Ridcully. I've tried it, mumbled the O-God. It just makes me feel suicidal and sick. A mixture of mustard and horseradish, said the chair of indefinite studies, in cream for preference with anchovies. Yogurt, said the bursar. Ridcully looked at him, surprised. "'That sounded almost relevant,' he said. "'Well done. I should leave it at that if I were you, Bursa. Hmm. Of course my uncle always used to swear at wow-wow sauce,' he added. "'You mean swear by, surely,' said the lecturer in recent runes. "'Possibly both,' said Ridcully. "'I know he once drank a whole bottle of it as a hangover cure, and it certainly seemed to cure him. He looked very peaceful when they came to lay him out.' "'Willow bark!' said the Bursa. That's a good idea, said the lecturer in recent runes. It's an analgesic. Really? Well, possibly, hmm, though it's probably better to give it to him by mouth, said Ridcully. I say, are you feeling yourself, Bursa? You seem somewhat coherent. The O-God opened his crusted eyes. Will all that stuff help? he mumbled. It'll probably kill you, said Susan. Oh, good. We could add Engelbert's enhancer said the dean. Remember when Mordo put some on his peas? We could only manage one each. Can't you do something more, well, magical, said Susan. Magic the alcohol out of him or something. Yes, but it's not alcohol by this time, is it, said Ridcully. It'll have turned into a lot of nasty little poisons all dancing round his liver. Spole's unstirring divisor would do it, said the lecturer in recent runes. Very simply, too. You'd end up with a large beaker full of all the nasties. Not difficult at all, if you don't mind the side effects. Tell me about the side effects, said Susan, who had met wizards before. The main one is that the rest of him would end up in a somewhat larger beaker, said the lecturer in recent runes. Alive? The lecturer in recent runes screwed up his face and waggled his hands. Broadly, yes, he said. Living tissue, certainly, and definitely sober. I think we had in mind something that would leave him the same shape and still breathing, said Susan. Well, huh, you might have said. Then the dean repeated the mantra that has had such a marked effect on the progress of knowledge throughout the ages. Why don't we just mix up absolutely everything and see what happens, he said. And Rid Cully responded with the traditional response. It's got to be worth a try, he said. The big glass beaker for the cure had been placed on a pedestal in the middle of the floor. 
The wizards liked to make a ceremony of everything in any case, but felt instinctively that if they were going to cure the biggest hangover in the world, it needed to be done with style. Susan and Bilius watched as the ingredients were added. Round about halfway, the mixture, which was an orange-brown colour, went gloop. Hmm, not a lot of improvement, I feel, said the lecturer in recent rooms. Engelbert's enhancer was the penultimate ingredient. The dean dropped in a greenish ball of light that sank under the surface. The only apparent effect was that it caused purple bubbles to creep over the sides of the beaker and drip onto the floor. <sighs> That's it, said the O God. I think the yoghurt probably wasn't a good idea, said the dean. I'm not drinking that, said Bilius firmly, and then clutched at his head. But gods are practically unkillable, aren't they? said the dean. Oh, good, muttered Bilius. Why not stick my legs in a meat grinder, then? Well, if you think it might help. I anticipated a certain amount of resistance from the patient, said the arch-chancellor. He removed his hat and fished out a small crystal ball from a pocket in the lining. Let's see what the god of wine is up to at the moment, shall we? Shouldn't be too difficult to locate a fun-loving god like him on an evening like this. He blew on the glass and polished it. Then he brightened up. Why, here he is, the little rascal, on done manifesting, I do believe. Yes, yes, reclining on his couch surrounded by naked maenads. What? Maniacs, said the dean. He means excitable young women, said Susan, and it seemed to her that there was a general ripple of movement among the wizards, a sort of nonchalant drawing towards the glittering ball. Can't quite see what he's doing, said Ridcully. Let me see if I can make it out, said the chair of indefinite studies, hopefully. Ridcully half turned to keep the ball out of his reach. Ah, yes, he said. It looks like he's drinking. Yes, could very well be a lager and black currant, if I'm any judge. Oh, me, moaned the O-God. These young women now, the lecturer in recent runes began. I can see there's some bottles on the table, Ridcully continued. That one, hmm, yes, could be... "'Scumble, which, as you know, is made from apples. "'Mainly apples,' the dean volunteered. "'Now, about these poor mad girls,' the O-God slumped to his knees. "'And there's that drink, you know, there's a, there's a worm in the bottle. "'Oh, me! "'And there's an empty glass, a big one, can't quite see what it contained, "'but there's a paper umbrella in it, and some cherries on a stick. "'Oh, <laughs> and an amusing little monkey. "'Oh!' "'Of course, there's a lot of other bottles, too,' said Red Cully cheerfully. "'Different coloured drinks, mainly. "'The sort made from melons and coconuts and chocolate and such like. "'Don't you know? Hmm? "'Funny thing is, all the glasses on the table are pint mugs.' "'Bilius fell forward. "'All right,' he murmured. "'I'll drink the wretched stuff.' "'Not quite ready yet,' said Red Cully. "'Ah, thank you, Modo.' "'Modo tiptoed in, pushing a trolley. There was a large metal bowl on it, in which a small bottle stood in the middle of a heap of crushed ice. "'Only just made this for Hogswatch dinner,' said Ridcully. "'Hasn't had much time to mature yet.' He put down the crystal and fished a pair of heavy gloves out of his hat. The wizards spread like an opening flower. One moment they were gathered around Ridcully, the next they were standing close to various items of heavy furniture. Susan felt she was present at a ceremony and hadn't been told the rules. "'What's that?' she said, as Ridcully carefully lifted up the bottle. "'Wow, wow, sauce,' said Ridcully. "'Finest condiment known to man. "'A happy accompaniment to meat, fish, fowl, eggs, and many types of vegetable dishes. "'It's not safe to drink it when sweat's still condensing on the bottle, though.' "'He peered at the bottle and then rubbed at it, causing a glassy, squeaky noise. "'On the other hand,' he said brightly, if it's a kill or cure remedy, then we are, given that the patient is practically immortal, probably on to a winner. He placed a thumb over the cork and shook the bottle vigorously. There was a crash as the chair of indefinite studies and the senior wrangler tried to get under the same table. And these fellows seem to have taken against it for some reason, he said, approaching the beaker. I prefer a sauce that doesn't mean you mustn't make any jolting movements for half an hour after using it, muttered the dean. "'And that can't be used for breaking up small rocks,' said the senior wrangler. "'Or getting rid of tree roots,' said the chair of indefinite studies. "'And which isn't exactly outlawed in three cities,' said the lecturer in recent runes. 
Ridcully cautiously uncorked the bottle. There was a brief hiss of indrawn air. He allowed a few drops to splash into the beaker. Nothing happened. A more generous helping was allowed to fall. The mixture remained irredeemably inert. Ridcully sniffed suspiciously at the bottle. I wonder if I added enough grated wahoony, he said, and then upturned the sauce and let most of it slide into the mixture. It merely went gloop. The wizards began to stand up and brush themselves off, giving one another the rather embarrassed grins of people who know that they've just been part of a synchronized making-a-fool-of-yourself team. I know we've had that as a fetida rather a long time, said Red Cully. He turned the bottle round, peering at it sadly. Finally, he tipped it up for the last time and th thumped it hard on the base. A trickle of sauce arrived on the lip of the bottle and glistened there for a moment. Then it began to form a bead. As if drawn by invisible strings, the heads of the wizards turned to look at it. Wizards wouldn't be wizards if they couldn't see a little way into the future. As the bead swelled and started to go pear-shaped, they turned, and with a surprising turn of speed for men so wealthy in years and waistline, began to dive for the floor. The drop fell. It went gloop. And that was all. Ridcully, who'd been standing like a statue, sagged in relief. Oh, I don't know, he said, turning away. I wish you fellows would show some backbone. The fireball lifted him off his feet. Then it rose to the ceiling, where it spread out widely and vanished with a pop, leaving a perfect chrysanthemum of scorched plaster. Pure white light filled the room, and there was a sound. Tinkle, tinkle, fizz! The wizards risked looking round. The beaker gleamed. It was filled with a liquid glow which bubbled gently and sent out sparkles like a spinning diamond. My word, breathed the lecturer in recent runes. Ridcully picked himself up off the floor. Wizards tended to roll well, or in any case are well padded enough to bounce. Slowly, the flickering brilliance casting their long shadows on the walls, the wizards gravitated towards the beaker. Well, what is it? said the dean. I remember my father telling me some very valuable advice about drinks, said Ridcully. He said, Son, never drink any drink with a paper umbrella in it, never drink any drink with a humorous name, and never drink any drink that changes colour when the last ingredient goes in, and never, ever do this. He dipped his finger into the beaker. It came out with one glistening drop on the end. Careful, Arch-Chancellor, warned the Dean. What you have there might represent pure sobriety. Ridcully paused with the finger halfway to his lips. Good point, he said. I don't want to start being sober at my time of life. He looked around. How do we usually test stuff? Generally, we ask for student volunteers, said the Dean. What happens if we don't get any? We give it to them anyway. Isn't that a bit unethical? Not if we don't tell them, Arch-Chancellor. Ah, good point. I'll try it, the O-God mumbled. Something these clown gentlemen have cooked up, said Susan. It might kill you. You've never had a hangover, I expect, said the O-God. Otherwise you wouldn't talk such rot. He staggered up to the beaker, managed to grip it on the second go, and drank the lot. Eh, uh, there'll be fireworks now, said the raven from Susan's shoulder. Flames coming out of the mouth. "'Screams clutching at the throat, lying down under the cold tap, that sort of thing.' "'Death found, to his amazement, that dealing with the queue was very enjoyable. "'Hardly anyone had ever been pleased to see him before. "'Next! And what's your name, little—' "'He hesitated, but rallied and continued. Mm, "'Person?' "'Nobby Nobbs, Hogfather,' said Nobby. Was it him, or was this knee he was sitting on a lot bonier than it should be? His buttocks argued with his brain, and were sat on. And have you been a good boar, a good dwar, a good no, a good individual? And suddenly Nobby found he had no control at all of his tongue. Of its own accord, gripped by a terrible compulsion, it said, Yes. He struggled for self-possession as the great voice went on. So I expect you'll want a present for a good monster, a good human, uh, a good male. Aha, got you, bang to rights. You'll be coming along with me, my old chummy. I bet you don't remember the cellar at the back of the shoelace makers in old cobblers, eh? All those hogs watch mornings with a little hole in my world, eh? 
The words rose in Nobby's throat, but were overridden by something ancient before they reached his voice box, and to his amazement were translated into... Yes. Something nice? Yes. There was hardly anything left of Nobby's conscious will now. The world consisted of nothing but his naked soul and the Hogfather who filled the universe. And you will, of course, be good for another year. The tiny remnant of basic nobbiness wanted to say, Er, uh, how exactly do you define good, mister? Like, suppose there was just some stuff that no one had miss, say? Or, for instance, say a friend of mine was on patrol, sort of thing, and found a shopkeeper had left his door unlocked at night. I mean, anyone could walk in, right? But suppose this friend took one or two things, sort of like, you know a gratuity, and then called the shopkeeper out and got him to lock up. That counts as good, does it? Good and bad were to Nobby's way of thinking entirely relative terms. Most of his relatives, for example, were criminals. But again, this invitation to philosophical debate was ambushed somewhere in his head by sheer dread of the big beard in the sky. Yes, he squeaked. Now, I wonder what you would like. Nobby gave up and sat mute. Whatever was going to happen next was going to happen, and there was not a thing he could do about it. Right now, the light at the end of his mental tunnel showed only more tunnel. Ah, yes. The Hogfather reached into his sack and pulled out an awkwardly shaped present wrapped in festive Hogswatch paper, which, owing to some slight confusion on the current Hogfather's part, had merry ravens on it. Corporal Nobbs took it in nervous hands. What do you say? Thank you. Off you go. Corporal Nobbs slid down gratefully and barged his way through the crowds, stopping only when he was fielded by Constable Visit. What happened? What happened? I couldn't see. I dunno, mumbled Nobby. He gave me this. What is it? I dunno. He clawed at the raven bedecked paper. This is disgusting, this whole business, said Constable Visit. It's the worship of idols. It's a genuine burly and strong in the arm double action triple cantilever crossbow with a polished walnut stock and engraved silver facings. A crass commercialization of a date which is purely of astronomical significance, said Visit, who seldom paid attention when he was in mid denounce. If it is to be celebrated at all, then I saw this in bows and ammo. It's got editor's choice in the what to buy when rich Uncle Sidney dies category. They had to break both the reviewer's arms to get him to let go of it. Ought to be commemorated in a small service of... It costs more than a year's salary. They only make them to order. You have to wait ages. Religious significance. It dawned on Constable Visit that something behind him was amiss. Aren't we going to arrest this imposter, Corporal? he said. Corporal Nobbs looked blearily at him through the mists of possessive pride. You're foreign, Washpot, he said. I can't expect you to know the real meaning of Hogswatch. The O-God blinked. Ugh, he said. Hmm, that's better. Oh, yes. Oh, that's a lot better, thank you. The wizards who shared the raven's belief in the essential narrative conventions of life watched him cautiously. Any minute now, said the lecturer in recent runes confidently. It'll probably start with some kind of amusing yell. You know, said the O-God, I think I could just possibly eat a soft-boiled egg. Or maybe the ears spinning round. And perhaps drink a glass of milk, said the O-God. Ridcully looked nonplussed. You really feel better, he said. Oh, yes, said the O-God. I really think I could risk... A smile without the top of my head falling off. No, 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 said the dean. This can't be right. Everyone knows that a good hangover cure has to involve a lot of humorous shouting, etc. I could possibly tell you a joke, said the O-God carefully. You don't have this pressing urge to run outside and stick your head in a water butt, said Ridcully. Um, not really, said the O-God. But I'd like some toast, if that helps. The dean took off his hat and pulled a thaumometer out of the point. Something happened, he said. There was a massive thaumic surge. Didn't it even taste a bit, well, <laughs> spicy, said Red Cully. It didn't taste of anything, really, said the O-God. 
Oh, look, it's obvious, said Susan. When the god of wine drinks, bilious here gets the after-effects. So when the god of hangovers drinks a hangover cure, then the effects must jump back across the same link. That could be right, said the dean. He is, after all, basically a conduit. I've always thought of myself as more of a tube, said the O god. No, no, she's right, said Ridcully. When he drinks, this lad here gets the nasty result. So logically, when our friend here takes a hangover cure, the side effects should head back the same way. Someone mentioned a crystal ball just now, said the O-God in a voice suddenly clanging with vengeance. I want to see this. It was a big drink, a very big and a very long drink. It was one of those special cocktails where each very sticky, very strong ingredient is poured in very slowly so that they layer on top of one another. Drinks like this tend to get called traffic lights or rainbow's revenge or, in places where truth is more highly valued, hello and goodbye, Mr. Brain Cell. In addition, this drink had some lettuce floating in it and a slice of lemon and a piece of pineapple hooked coquettishly on the side of the glass which had sugar frosted round the rim. There were two paper umbrellas, one pink and one blue, and they each had a cherry on the end. And someone had taken the trouble to freeze ice cubes in the shape of little elephants. After that, there's no hope. You might as well be drinking in a place called the Coca Cobana. The god of wine picked it up lovingly. It was his kind of drink. There was a rumba going on in the background. There were also a couple of young ladies snuggling up to him. It was going to be a good night. It was always a good night. Happy Hogs Watch, everyone, he said and raised the glass. And then, can anyone hear something? Something blew a paper squeaker at him. No, seriously, like a sort of descending note. Since no one paid this any attention, he shrugged and nudged one of his fellow drinkers. How about we have a couple more and go to this club I know, he said. And then... The wizards leaned back, and one or two of them grimaced. Only the O-God stayed glued to the glass, face contorted in a vicious smile. "'We have eructation!' he shouted, and punched the air. "'Yes! Yes! Yes! The worm is on the other boot now, eh? Ha! <laughs> How do you like them apples? Ha! <laughs> "'Well, mainly apples,' said the dean. "'Look like a lot of other things to me,' said Red Cully. It seems we have reversed the cause-effect flow. Will it be permanent? said the O-God, hopefully. I shouldn't think so. After all, you are the god of hangovers. It'll probably just reverse itself again when the potion wears off. Then I may not have much time. Bring me, uh, let's see, uh, twenty pints of lager, some pepper vodka and a bottle of coffee liqueur with an umbrella in it. Let's see how he enjoys that, mister. You've got room for another one in there. Susan grabbed his hand and pulled him over to a bench. I didn't have you sobered up just so you could go on a binge, she said. He blinked at her. You didn't? I want you to help me. Help you what? You said you'd never been human before, didn't you? Um... The O-God looked down at himself. That's right, he said. Never. You've never incarnated, said Ridcully. Surely that's a, a, a rather personal question, isn't it? said the Chair of Indefinite Studies. That's right, said the O-God. Odd that. I remember always having headaches, but never having a head. That can't be right, can it? You existed in potentia, said Ridcully. Did I? Did he? said Susan. Ridcully paused. Oh, dear, he said. I think I did it, didn't I? I said something to young Stibbons about drinking and hangovers, didn't I? And you created him just like that, said the dean. I find that very hard to believe, Mustrum. <laughs> Out of thin air. I suppose we can all do that, can we? Anyone care to think up some new pixie? Like the hair loss fairy, said the lecturer in recent runes. The other wizards laughed. I am not losing my hair, snapped the dean. It is just very finely spaced. Half on your head and half on your hairbrush, said the lecturer in recent runes. No sense in being bashful about going bald, said Ridcully evenly. Anyway, you know what they say about bald men, dean. Yes, they say, look at him, he's got no hair, 
said the lecturer in recent rooms. The dean had been annoying him lately. For the last time, shouted the dean, I am not. He stopped. There was a glingalingalingalingalingalinga noise. I wish I knew where that was coming from, said Ridcully. Er,、uh, the dean began, is there something on my head? The other wizards stared. Something was moving under his hat. Very carefully he reached up and removed it. A very small gnome sitting on his head had a clump of the dean's hair in each hand. It blinked guiltily in the light. Uh, yeah, is there a problem? it said. Get it off me! the dean yelled. The wizards hesitated. They were all vaguely aware of the theory that very small creatures could pass on diseases, and while the gnome was larger than such creatures were generally thought to be, no one wanted to catch expanding scalp sickness. Susan grabbed it. Are you the hair loss fairy? she said. Uh, apparently, said the gnome, wriggling in her grip. The dean ran his hands desperately through his hair. What have you been doing with my hair? he demanded. Well, some of it I think I have to put on hair brushes. Said the gnome, but sometimes I think、uh, I weave it into little mats to block up the bath with. What do you mean you think? Said Ridcully. Just a minute, said Susan. She turned to the ogod. Where exactly were you before I found you in the snow? Um, sort of、uh, everywhere, I think. Said the ogod. Anywhere where drink has been consumed in beastly quantities some time previously, you could say. Ah ha! Said Ridcully. You were an imminent vital force, yes. I suppose I could have been, the ogod conceded. And when we joked about the hair loss fairy, it suddenly focused on the dean's head, said Ridcully, where its operations have been noticeable to all of us in recent months. Although, of course, we have been far too polite to pass comment on the subject. You're calling things into being, said Susan. Things like the give the dean a huge bag of money goblin," said the dean, who could think very quickly at times. He looked around hopefully. "Anyone hear any fairy tinkling? Do you often get given huge bags of money, sir?" said Susan. "Not on what you'd call a daily basis, no," said the dean. "But if、um, <laughs> then there probably isn't any occult room for a huge bags of money goblin," said Susan. "I personally." Have always wondered what happens to my socks," said the bursar cheerfully. "You know how there's always one missing. When I was a lad, I always thought that something was taking them." The wizards gave this some thought. Then they all heard it: the little crinkly, tinkling noise of magic taking place. The arch chancellor pointed dramatically skywards. "To the laundry," he said. "It's downstairs, Ridcully," said the dean. "Down to the laundry." And you know, Mrs. Whitlow doesn't like us going in there," said the chair of indefinite studies. "And who is Arch Chancellor of this university, may I ask?" said Ridcully. "Is it Mrs. Whitlow? I don't think so. Is it me? Why, how amazing! I do believe it is." "Yes, but you know what she can be like," said the chair. "Um, yes, that's true." Ridcully began. "I believe she's gone to her sister's." For the holiday," said the bursar. "We certainly don't have to take orders from any kind of housekeeper," said the arch chancellor. "To the laundry!" The wizards surged out excitedly, leaving Susan, the ogod, the Veruca gnome, and the hair loss fairy. "Tell me again who those people were," said the ogod. "Some of the cleverest men in the world," said Susan. "And I'm sober, am I?" "Clever isn't the same as sensible," said Susan. And they do say that if you wish to walk the path to wisdom, then for your first step you must become as a small child. Do you think they've heard about the second step? Susan sighed. Probably not, but sometimes they fall over it while they're running around shouting. Ah,、oh, the ogre looked around. Do you think they have any soft drinks here? He said. The path to wisdom does, in fact, begin with a single step. Where people go wrong is in ignoring all the thousands of other steps that come after it. They make the single step of deciding to become one with the universe, and for some reason forget to take the logical next step of living for seventy years on a mountain and a daily bowl of rice and yak butter tea that would give it any kind of meaning. While evidence says that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, they're probably all on first steps. 
The dean was always at his best at times like this. He led the way between the huge ancient copper vats, prodding with his staff into dark corners and going, Hut! Hut! under his breath. Why would it turn up here? whispered the lecturer in recent runes. Point of reality instability, said Ridcully, standing on tiptoe to look into a bleaching cauldron. Every damn thing turns up here. You should know that by now. But why now? said the chair of indefinite studies. No talking, hissed the dean, and leapt out into the next alleyway, staff held protectively in front of him. Ha! he screamed, and then looked disappointed. Ah, uh, how big would this sock-stealing thing be? said the senior wrangler. Don't know, said Ridcully. He peered behind a stack of washboards. Come to think of it, I must have lost a ton of socks over the years. Me too, said the lecturer in recent runes. So should we be looking in small places or very large places? The senior wrangler went on in the voice of one whose train of thought has just entered a long, dark tunnel. Good point, said Ridcully. Dean, why do you keep referring to sheds all the time? It's hut, Mustram, said the dean. It means... It means small wooden building, Ridcully suggested. Well, sometimes agreed, but other times, well, well, you just have to say hut. This sock creature, does it just steal them or does it eat them? said the senior wrangler. Valuable contribution, that man, said Ridcully, giving up on the dean. Right, pass the word along. No one is to look like a sock, understand? How can you? the dean began and stopped. They all heard it. It was a busy sound, the sound of something with a serious appetite to satisfy. The eater of socks, moaned the senior wrangler with his eyes shut. How many tentacles would you expect it to have, said the lecturer in recent rooms, I mean, roughly speaking. It's a very large sort of noise, isn't it, said the bursar. To the nearest dozen, say, said the lecturer in recent runes, edging backwards. <laughs> It'd probably tear our socks off as soon as look at us, wailed the senior wrangler. Ah, so at least five or six tentacles then, would you say, said the lecturer in recent runes. Seems to me it's coming from one of the washing engines, said the dean. The engines were each two stories high, and usually only used when the university's population soared during term time. A huge treadmill connected to a couple of big bleached wooden paddles in each vat, which were heated via the fireboxes underneath. In full production, the washing engines needed at least half a dozen people to manhandle the loads, maintain the fires, and oil the scrubbing arms. Ridcully had seen them at work once, when it had looked like a picture of a very clean and hygienic hell, the kind of place soap might go to when it died. The dean stopped by the door to the boiler area. Something's in here, he whispered. Listen. <laughs> it's stopped. It knows we're here, he hissed. All right. Ready. Hut. No, squeaked the lecturer in recent rooms. I'll open the door and you'll be ready to stop it. One, two, three. Oh. The sleigh soared into the snowy sky. On the whole, I think that went very well, don't you? Yes, master, said Albert. I was rather puzzled by the little boy in the chain mail, though. I think that was a watchman, master. Really? Well, he went away happy, and that's the main thing. Is it, master? There was worry in Albert's voice. Death's osmotic nature tended to pick up new ideas altogether too quickly. Of course, Albert understood why they had to do all this, but the master, well, sometimes the master lacked the necessary mental equipment to work out what should be true and what shouldn't. And I think I've got the laugh working really well now. Ho, ho, ho! Yes, uh, very jolly, said Albert. He looked down at the list. Still work goes on, eh? The next one's pretty close, master, so I should keep them down low if I was you. Jolly good. Who, who, who? Sarah, the little match girl, doorway of Thimble's Pipe and Tobacco Shop, Money Trap Lane, it says here. And what does she want for Hog's Watch? Ho, ho, ho. You know, never seen a letter. 
By the way, just a tip, you don't have to say ho, ho, ho all the time, Master. Let's see, uh, says here, Albert's lips moved as he read. I expect a doll is always acceptable, or a soft toy of some description. The sack seems to know. What have we got for her, Albert, ho, ho, ho? Something small was dropped into his hand. This, said Albert. Oh. There was a moment of horrible silence as they both stared at the lifetimer. You're for life, not just for Hogswatch, prompted Albert. Life goes on, master, in a manner of speaking. But this is Hogswatch night. Very traditional time for this sort of thing, I understand, said Albert. I thought it was the season to be jolly. Said Death. Ah, well, yes. You see, one of the things that makes folks even more jolly is knowing that there's people who ain't. Said Albert in a matter-of-fact voice. That's how it goes, Master. Master. No. Death stood up. This is how it shouldn't go. The university's great hall had been set for the Hogswatch night feast. The tables were already groaning under the weight of the cutlery, and it would be hours before any real food was put on them. It was hard to see where there would be space for any among the drifts of ornamental fruit bowls and forests of wine glasses. The ogre picked up a menu and turned to the fourth page. Course four: mollusks and crustaceans. A medley of lobster, crab, king crab, prawn, shrimp, oyster, clam, giant mussel, green lipped mussel, thin lipped mussel. And fighting tiger limpet, with a herb and butter dipping sauce, wine, three wizards Chardonnay, year of the talking frog, beer, Winkle's old peculiar. He put it down. That's one course, he said. They are big men in the food department, said Susan. He turned the menu over. On the cover was the university's coat of arms, and over it three large letters in ancient script: Eater, Beta. Pie. Is this some sort of magic word? No, Susan sighed. They put it on all their menus. You might call it the unofficial motto of the university. What's it mean? Eater, better, pie. Billius gave her an expectant look. Yes. Uh, like, eat a better pie, said Susan. That's what you just said. Yes, said the ogre. Uh, no. You see, the letters are Ephebian characters, which just sound a bit like "eat a better pie." Ah,、oh, Billius nodded wisely. I can see that might cause confusion. Susan felt a bit helpless in the face of the look of helpful puzzlement. No, she said. In fact, they are supposed to cause a little bit of confusion, and then you laugh. It's called a pun or play on words. Eat a better pie. She eyed him carefully. You laugh," she said, "with your mouth. Only, in fact, you don't laugh because you're not supposed to laugh at things like this. Perhaps I could find that glass of milk," said the ogre helplessly, peering at the huge array of jugs and bottles. He'd clearly given up on sense of humour. "I gather the Arch Chancellor won't have milk in the university," said Susan. "He says he knows where it comes from and it's unhygienic, and that's a man who eats three eggs for breakfast every day, Mark. You. How do you know about milk, by the way?" I've got memories," said the ogre. "Not exactly of anything、uh, specific, just you know, memories. Like I know trees usually grow green end up, that sort of thing. I suppose gods just know things. Any special godlike powers? I might be able to turn water into an enervescent drink." He pinched the bridge of his nose. "Is that any help? And it's just possible I can give people a blinding headache." I need to find out why my grandfather is acting strange. Can't you ask him? He won't tell me. Does he throw up a lot? I shouldn't think so. He doesn't often eat. The occasional curry, once or twice a month. He must be pretty thin. You've no idea. Well then, does he often stare at himself in the mirror and say, "Ah,"、uh, or stick out his tongue and wonder why it's gone yellow? You see, it's possible I might have some measure of influence over people who are hung over. If he's been drinking a lot, I might be able to find him. I can't see him doing any of those things. I think I'd better tell you. My grandfather is death. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I said death. Sorry, death. You know, death. 
You mean the robes and the, the scythe, yes, white horse, bones, yes, death. I just want to make sure I've got this clear, said the O-God in a reasonable tone of voice. You think your grandfather is death, and you think he's acting strange. The Eater of Socks looked up at the wizards cautiously. Then its jaws started to work again. Here, that's one of mine, said the Chair of Indefinite Studies, making a grab. The Eater of Socks backed away hurriedly. It looked like a very small elephant with a very wide, flared trunk, up which one of the Chair's socks was disappearing. Funny-looking little thing, ain't it? said Ridcully, leaning his staff against the wall. Let go, you wretched creature, said the chair, making a grab for the sock. Shoo! The sock-eater tried to get away while remaining where it was. This should be impossible, but it is in fact a move attempted by many small animals when they are caught eating something forbidden. The legs scrabble hurriedly, but the neck and feverishly working jaws merely stretch and pivot around the food. Finally, the last of the sock disappeared up the snout with a faint sucking noise, and the creature lumbered off behind one of the boilers. After a while, it poked one suspicious eye around the corner to watch them. "'They're expensive, you know, with the flax-reinforced heel,' muttered the chair of indefinite studies. Ridcully pulled open a drawer in his hat and extracted his pipe and a pouch of herbal tobacco. He struck a match on the side of the washing engine. This was turning out to be a far more interesting evening than he had anticipated. "'We've got to get this sorted out.' he said, as the first few puffs filled the washing hall with the scent of autumn bonfires. Can't have creatures just popping into existence because someone's thought about them. It's unhygienic. The sleigh slewed around at the end of Money Trap Lane. Come on, Albert. You know you're not supposed to do this sort of thing, Master. You know what happened last time. The Hogfather can do it, though. But... Little match girls dying in the snow is part of what the Hogs Watch spirit is all about, Master, said Albert desperately. I mean, people hear about it and say we may be poorer than a disabled banana and only have mud and old boots to eat, but at least we're better off than the poor little match girl, Master. It makes them feel happy and grateful for what they've got, see? I know what the spirit of Hogs Watch is, Albert. Sorry, Master, but look, it's all right anyway, because she wakes up and it's all bright and shining and tinkling music and there's angels, Master. Death stopped. Ah, they turn up at the last minute with warm clothes and a hot drink. Oh dear, thought Albert, the Master's really in one of his funny moods now. Er, uh, no, not exactly at the last minute, Master, not as such. Well? More sort of just after the last minute, Albert coughed nervously. You mean after she's... Yes, that's how the story goes, Master. It's not my fault. Why not turn up before? An angel has quite a large carrying capacity. Couldn't say, Master. I suppose people think it's more... satisfying the other way. Albert hesitated and then frowned. You know, now that I've come to tell someone, it... Death looked down at the shape under the falling snow. Then he set the lifetimer on the air and touched it with a finger. A spark flashed across. You ain't really allowed to do that, said Albert, feeling wretched. The Hogfather can. The Hogfather gives presents. There's no better present than a future. Yeah, but... Albert! All right, master. Death scooped up the girl and strode to the end of the alley. The snowflakes fell like angel's feathers. Death stepped out into the street and accosted two figures who were tramping through the drifts. Take her somewhere warm and give her a good dinner he commanded, pushing the bundle into the arms of one of them. And I may well be checking up later. Then he turned and disappeared into the swirling snow. Constable Visit looked down at the little girl in his arms and then at Corporal Nobbs. What's all this about, Corporal? Nobby pulled aside the blanket. Search me, he said. Looks like we've been chosen to do a bit of charity. I don't call it very charitable just dumping someone on people like this. Come on. There'll still be some grub left in the watch house, said Nobby. He'd got a very deep and certain feeling that this was expected of him. He remembered a big man in a grotto, although he couldn't quite remember the face, and he couldn't quite remember the face of the person who had handed over the girl, so that meant it must be the same one. Shortly afterwards, there was some tinkling music and a very bright light, and two rather affronted angels appeared at the other end of the alley, but Albert threw snowballs at them until they went away.
Hex worried Ponder Stibbons. He didn't know how it worked, but everyone else assumed that he did. Oh, he had a good idea about some parts, and he was pretty certain that Hex thought about things by turning them all into numbers and crunching them. A clothes ringer from the laundry, or CWL, had been plumbed in for this very purpose. But why did it need a lot of small religious pictures? And there was the mouse. It didn't seem to do much, but whenever they forgot to give it its cheese, Hex stopped working. There were all those ram skulls. The ants wandered over to them occasionally, but they didn't seem to do anything. What Ponder was worried about was the fear that he was simply engaged in a cargo cult. He'd read about them. Ignorant and credulous people, whose island might once have been visited by some itinerant merchant vessel that traded pearls and coconuts for such fruits of civilization as glass beads, mirrors, axes and sexual diseases, would later make big model ships out of bamboo in the hope of once again attracting this magical cargo. Ignorant is a state of not knowing what a pronoun is, or how to find the square root of 27.4, and merely knowing childish and useless things like which of the seventy almost identical-looking species of the purple sea snake are the deadly ones, how to treat the poisonous pith of the sago-sago tree to make a nourishing gruel, how to foretell the weather by the movements of the tree-climbing burglar crab, how to navigate across a thousand miles of featureless ocean by means of a piece of string and a small clay model of your grandfather, how to get essential vitamins from the liver of the ferocious ice bear, and other such trivial matters. It's a strange thing that when everyone becomes educated, everyone knows about the pronoun, but no one knows about the sago-sago. And credulous is having views about the world, the universe, and humanity's place in it that are shared only by very unsophisticated people and the most intelligent and advanced mathematicians and physicists. Of course, they were far too ignorant and credulous, to know that just because you built the shape, you didn't get the substance. He'd built the shape of Hex, and it occurred to him he'd built it in a magical university, where the border between real and not real was stretched so thin you could almost see through it. He got the horrible suspicion that somehow they were merely making a solid sketch that was hidden somewhere in the air. Hex knew what it ought to be. All that business about the electricity, for example... Hex had raised the subject one night not long after it had asked for the mouse. Ponder prided himself that he knew pretty much all there was to know about electricity. But they'd tried rubbing balloons and glass rods until they'd been able to stick Adrian onto the ceiling, and it hadn't had any effect on Hex. Then they'd tried tying a lot of cats to a wheel, which, when revolved against some beads of amber, caused any amount of electricity all over the place. The wretched stuff hung around for days, but there didn't seem to be any way of ladling it into Hex. And anyway, no one could stand the noise. So far, the Arch-Chancellor had vetoed the lightning rod idea. All this depressed Ponder. He was certain that the world ought to work in a more efficient way, and now even the things that he thought were going right were going wrong. He stared glumly at Hex's quill pen in its tangle of springs and wire. The door was thrown open. Only one person could make a door bang on its hinges like that. Ponder didn't even turn round. Hello again, Arch-Chancellor. That thinking engine of yours working, said Ridcully, only there's an interesting little... It's not working, said Ponder. It ain't. What's this, a half-holiday for Hogswatch? Look, said Ponder. Hex wrote, plus, 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 whoops, here comes the cheese. Plus, 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 melon, 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 plus, 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 error at address, 14 Treacle Mine Road, Ankh Morpork, plus, 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 Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, plus, 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 one, 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 plus, 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 redo from start, plus, plus, plus. What's going on? said Ridcully, as the others pushed in behind him. I know it sounds stupid, Arch-Chancellor, but we think it might have caught something off the bursa. Daftness, you mean? That's ridiculous, boy, said the Dean. Idiocy is not a communicable disease. Ridcully puffed his pipe. I used to think that, too, he said. Now I'm not so sure. Anyway, you can catch wisdom, can't you? No, you can't, snapped the dean. It's not like flu, Ridcully. Wisdom is, well, instilled. We bring students in here and hope they catch wisdom off us, don't we? said Ridcully. Well, metaphorically, said the dean. And if you hang around with a bunch of idiots, you're bound to become pretty daft yourself, Ridcully went on. I suppose in a manner of speaking... And you've only got to talk to the poor old bursar for five minutes, and you think you're going a bit potty yourself, am I right? The wizards nodded glumly. 
The bursar's company, although quite harmless, had a habit of making one's brain squeak. So Hex here has caught daftness off the bursar, said Ridcully. Simple. Real stupidity beats artificial intelligence every time. He banged his pipe on the side of Hex's listening tube and shouted, Feeling all right, old chap? Hex wrote, Plus, plus, plus. Hi, mum is testing. Plus, plus, plus. Melon, melon, melon. Plus, plus, plus. Out of cheese error. Plus, plus, plus. Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Plus, plus, plus. Mr. Jelly, Mr. Jelly. Plus, plus, plus. Hex seems perfectly able to work out anything purely to do with numbers, but when it tries anything else, it does this, said Ponder. See? Bursa disease, said Ridcully. The bee's knees when it comes to adding up, the pig's ear at everything else. Try giving him dried frog pills? Sorry, sir, but that is a very uninformed suggestion, said Ponder. You can't give medicine to machines. Don't see why not, said Ridcully. He banged on the tube again and bellowed, Soon have your back on your... your yes, indeed, old chap. Uh, where's that board with all the letter and number buttons, Mr. Stibbons? Ah, good. He sat down and typed with one finger as slowly as a company chairman. Deride fog half pills. Hex's pipes jangled. That can't possibly work, sir, said Ponder. It ought to, said Ridcully. If he can get the idea of being ill, he can get the idea of being cured. He typed, Lots of dried frog per quarter ulls. Seems to me, he said, that this thing believes what it's told, right? Well, it's true that Hex has, if you want to put it that way, no idea of an untruth. Right. Well, I've just told the thing it's had a lot of dried frog pills. It's not going to call me a liar, is it? There were some clickings and whirrings within the structure of Hex. Then it wrote, plus, plus, plus. Good evening, Arch-Chancellor. I am fully recovered and enthusiastic about my tasks. Plus, plus, plus. Not mad, then. Plus, plus, plus. I assure you, I am as sane as the next man. Plus, plus, plus. Bursa, <clears throat> just uh, move away from the machine, will you? said Ridcully. Oh, well, I expect it's the best we're going to get. Right, let's get all this sorted out. We want to find out what's going on. Anywhere specific or just everywhere, said Ponder, a shade sarcastically. There was a scratching noise from Hex's pen. Ridcully glanced down at the paper. Says here, implied creation of anthropomorphic personification, he said. Hmm, what's that mean? Er, uh, I think Hex has tried to work out the answer, said Ponder. Has it, by gods? I hadn't even worked out what the question was yet. It heard you talking, sir. Ridcully raised his eyebrows. Then he leaned down towards the speaking tube. Can you hear me in there? The pen scratched. Plus, plus, plus. Yes, plus, plus, plus. Looking after you all right, are they? You don't have to shout, Arch-Chancellor, said Ponder. What's this mm, implied creation, then? said Ridcully. Uh, I think I've heard of it, Arch-Chancellor, said Ponder. It means the existence of some things automatically brings into existence other things. If some things exist, certain other things have to exist as well. Like uh, crime and punishment, say, said Ridcully. Drinking and hangovers, of course. Something like that, yes, sir. So, hmm, if there's a, a tooth fairy, then there has to be a Veruca gnome. Ridcully stroked his beard. Makes a sort of sense, I suppose, but why not a wisdom tooth goblin? You know, bringing them extra ones, some little devil with a bag of big teeth. There was a silence, but in the depths of the silence... There was a little tingly fairy bell sound. Um, do you think I might have, uh, Ridcully began. Sounds logical to me, said the senior wrangler. I remember the agony I had when my wisdom teeth came through. Last week, said the dean and smirked. Ah, said Ridcully. He didn't look embarrassed because people like Ridcully are never, ever embarrassed about anything, although often people are embarrassed on their behalf. He bent down to the ear trumpet again. You still in there? Ponder Stibbons rolled his eyes. Mind telling us what the reality is like round here? The pen wrote, plus, plus, plus. 
on a scale of one to ten, dash, query, plus, plus, plus. Fine, Ridcully shouted. Plus, plus, plus. Divide by cucumber error. Please reinstall universe and reboot. Plus, plus, plus. Hmm, interesting, said Ridcully. Anyone know what that means? Damn, said Ponder. It's crashed again. Ridcully looked mystified. Has it? I never even saw it take off. I mean, it's... It's sort of gone a little mad, said Ponder. Ah, said Ridcully. Well, we're experts at that round here. He thumped on the drum again. Want some more dried frog pills, old chap? He shouted. Uh, I should let us sort it out, Arch-Chancellor, said Ponder, trying to steer him away. What does divide by cucumber mean? said Ridcully. Oh, Hex just says that if it comes up with an answer that it knows can't possibly be real, said Ponder. And this, um... <laughs> "'Rebooting business. Give it a good kicking, do you?' "'Oh, no, of course not. We... that is... well... yes, in fact,' said Ponder. "'Adrian goes round the back and, um, prods it with his foot. "'But in a, in a technical way,' he added. "'Ah, I think I'm getting the hang of this thinking engine business,' said Ridcully cheerfully. "'So it reckons the universe needs a kicking, does it?' "'Hex's pen was scratching across the paper.' Ponder glanced at the figures. It must do. These figures can't be right. Ridcully grinned again. You mean either the whole world has gone wrong, or your machine is wrong? Yes. Then I'd imagine the answer's pretty easy, wouldn't you? said Ridcully. Yes, it certainly is. Hex gets thoroughly tested every day, said Ponder Stibbons. Good point, that man, said Ridcully. He banged on Hex's listening tube once more. You down there! You really don't need to shout, Arch-Chancellor, said Ponder. What's this anthropomorphic personification, then? Plus, plus, plus. Humans have always ascribed random, seasonal, natural, or inexplicable actions to human-shaped entities. Such examples are Jack Frost, the Hogfather, the Tooth Fairy, and Death. Plus, plus, plus. Oh, them! Yes, but they exist, said Ridcully. Met a couple of them myself. Plus, plus, plus. Humans are not always wrong. Plus, plus, plus. All right, but I'm damn sure there's never been an eater of socks or a god of hangovers. Plus, plus, plus. But there is no reason why there should not be. Plus, plus, plus. The thing's right, you know, said the lecturer in recent runes. A little man who carries verrucas around is no more ridiculous than someone who takes away children's teeth for money when you come to think about it. Yes, but what about the eater of socks? said the chair of indefinite studies. Bursa just said he always thought something was eating his socks, and bingo, there it was. But we all believed him, didn't we? I know I did. Seems like the best possible explanation for all the socks I've lost over the years— I mean, if they'd just fallen down the back of the drawer or something, there'd be a mountain of the things by now. I know what you mean, said Ponder. It's like pencils. I must have bought hundreds of pencils over the years, but how many have I ever actually worn down to the stub? Even I've caught myself thinking that something's creeping up and eating them. There was a faint glinga -ling 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 noise. He froze. What was that? he said. Should I look round? Will I see something horrible? Looks like a very puzzled bird said Ridcully. With a very odd-shaped beak, said the lecturer in recent runes. I wish I knew who's making that bloody tinkling noise, said the Arch-Chancellor. The O-God listened attentively. Susan was amazed. He didn't seem to disbelieve anything. She'd never been able to talk like this before, and said so. I think it's because I haven't got any preconceived ideas, said the O-God. It comes of not having been conceived, probably. Well, that's how it is anyway, said Susan. Obviously, I haven't inherited physical characteristics. I suppose I just look at the world in a certain way. What way? It doesn't always present barriers. Like this, for example. She closed her eyes. She felt better if she didn't see what she was doing. Part of her would keep on insisting it was impossible. All she felt was a faintly cold, prickling sensation. What did I just do? she said, her eyes still shut. Er, uh, you waved your hand through the table, said the O-God. You see? 
Um, I, I assume that most humans can't do that. No! You don't have to shout. I'm not very experienced about humans, am I? Apart from around the point the sun shines through the gap in the curtains. And then they're mainly wishing that the ground would open up and swallow them. I mean, the humans, not the curtains. Susan leaned back in her chair and knew that a tiny part of her brain was saying, Yes, there is a chair here. It's a real thing. You can sit on it. There's other things, she said. I can remember things. Things that haven't happened yet. Isn't that useful? No, because I never know what they... <sighs> Look, it's like looking at the future through a keyhole. You see bits of things, but you never really know what they mean until you arrive where they are and see where the bit fits in. That could be a problem, said the O-God politely. Believe me, it's the waiting that's the worst part. You keep watching out for one of the bits to go past. I mean, I don't usually remember anything useful about the future, just twisted little clues that don't make sense until it's too late. Are you sure you don't know why you turned up at the Hogfather's Castle? No, I just remember being a... Well, can you understand what I mean by a disembodied mind? Oh, yes. Good. Now, can you understand what I mean by a disembodied headache? And then, next moment, I was lying on a back I didn't used to have in a lot of cold white stuff I'd never seen before. But I suppose if you're going to pop into existence, you've got to do it somewhere. Somewhere where someone else who should have existed didn't, said Susan, half to herself. Pardon? The Hogfather wasn't there, said Susan. He shouldn't have been there anyway, not tonight. But this time he wasn't there not because he was somewhere else, but because he wasn't anywhere anymore. Even his castle was vanishing. I expect I shall get the hang of this incarnation business as I go along, said the O-God. Most people, Susan began. A shudder ran through her body. Oh, no, what's he doing? What's he doing? A job well done, I fancy. The sleigh thundered across the night. Frozen fields passed underneath. Hm, said Albert. He sniffed. What do you call that warm feeling you get inside? Heartburn, Albert snapped. Do I detect a note of unseasonal grumpiness, said Death? No sugar piggy-wiggy for you, Albert. I don't want any presents, Master, Albert sighed, except maybe to wake up and find it's all back to normal. Look, you know it always goes wrong when you start changing things. But the Hogfather can change things. Little miracles all over the place, with many a merry ho-ho-ho, teaching people the real meaning of Hog's Watch, Albert. What? You mean that the pigs and cattle have all been slaughtered, and with any luck everyone's got enough food for the winter? Well, when I say the real meaning... Some wretched devil's had his head chopped off in a wood somewhere because he found a bean in his dinner and now the summer's going to come back. Not exactly that, but... Oh, you mean that they've chased down some poor beast and shot arrows up into their apple trees, and now the shadows are going to go away? That is definitely a meaning, but I... Ah, then you're talking about the one where they light a big bloody bonfire to give the sun a hint and tell it to stop lurking under the horizon and do a proper day's work. Death paused, while the hogs hurtled over a range of hills. You're not helping, Albert. Well, they're all the real meanings that I know. I think you could work with me on this. It's all about the sun, master. White snow and red blood and the sun. Always has been. Very well, then. The Hogfather can teach people the unreal meaning of Hog's Watch. Albert spat over the side of the sleigh. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if everyone was nice, eh? There are worse battle cries. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Excuse me. Death reached into his robe and pulled out an hourglass. Turn the sleigh round, Albert. Duty calls. Which one? A more positive attitude would assist at this point. Thank you so very much. Fascinating. Anyone got another pencil? said Ridcully. It's had four already said the lecturer in recent runes, right down to the stub, Arch-Chancellor, and you know we buy our own these days. It was a sore point. Like most people with no grasp whatsoever of real economics, Mustram Ridcully equated proper financial control with the counting of paper clips. 
Even senior wizards had to produce a pencil stub to him before they were allowed a new one out of the locked cupboard below his desk. Since, of course, hardly anyone retained a half-used pencil, the wizards had been reduced to sneaking out and buying new ones with their own money. The reason for the dearth of short pencils was perched in front of them, whirring away as it chewed an HB down to the eraser on the end, which it spat at the bursar. Ponder Stibbons had been making notes. I think it works like this, he said. What we're getting is the personification of forces, just like Hex said, but it only works if the thing is, well, logical, he swallowed. Ponder was a great believer in logic, in the face of all the local evidence, and he hated having to use the word in this way. I don't mean it's logical that there's a creature that eats socks, but it, uh, uh, it makes a sort of sense. I mean, I mean it's a working hypothesis. Bit like the Hogfather, said Ridcully. When you're a kiddie, he's as good an explanation as any, right? What's not logical about there being a goblin that brings me huge bags of money? said the dean sulkily. Ridcully fed the stealer of pencils another pencil. Well, sir, firstly, you've never mysteriously received huge bags of money and needed to find a hypothesis to explain them, and secondly, no one else would think it at all likely. Huh. <laughs> Why is it happening now? said Ridcully. Look, it's hopped onto my finger. Anyone got another pencil? Well, these... Forces have always been here, said Ponder. I mean, socks and pencils have always inexplicably gone missing, haven't they? But why they're suddenly getting personified like this, I'm afraid I don't know. Well, we'd better find out, hadn't we, said Ridcully. Can't have this sort of thing going on. Daft anti-gods and miscellaneous whatnots being created just because people have thought about them. We could have anything turn up anyway. Supposing some idiot says there must be a god of indigestion, eh? Glingle, 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 glingle. Um, I think someone just did, sir, said Ponder. What's the matter? What's the matter? said the O-God. He took Susan by the shoulders. They felt bony under his hands. Damn, said Susan. She pushed him away and steadied herself on the table, taking care that he didn't see her face. Finally, with a measure of the self-control she'd taught herself over the last few years, she managed to get her own voice back. He's slipping out of character, she muttered, to the hall in general. I can feel him doing it, and that drags me in. What's he doing it all for? Search me, said the O-God, who'd backed away hurriedly. Um, just then, before you turned your face away, it looked as though you were wearing very dark eyeshadow. Only you weren't... Look, it's very simple, said Susan, spinning round. She could feel her hair restyling itself, which it always did when it was anxious. You know how stuff runs in families? Blue eyes, buck teeth, that sort of thing. Well, death runs in my family. Um, in everybody's family, doesn't it? said the O-God. Just shut up, please. Don't gabble, said Susan. I didn't mean death. I meant death, with a capital D. I remember things that haven't happened yet, and I can talk that talk, and stalk that stalk, and if he gets sidetracked, then I'll have to do it. And he does get sidetracked. I don't know what's really happened to the real Hogfather, or why Grandfather's doing his job, but I know a bit about how he thinks, and he's got no, no mental shields like we have. He doesn't know how to forget things or ignore things. He takes everything literally and logically, and doesn't understand why that doesn't always work. She saw his bemused expression. Look, how would you make sure everyone in the world was well fed? She demanded. Me? Oh, well, I... Uh... The O-God spluttered for a moment. I suppose you'd have to think about the prevalent political systems and the proper division and cultivation of arable land and... Yes, yes, but he'd just give everyone a good meal, said Susan. Oh, I see. Very impractical. <laughs> it's as silly as saying you could clothe the naked by... Ugh, giving them some clothes. Yes. I mean, no, of course not. I mean, obviously you'd give... Oh, you know what I mean. Yes, I suppose so. But he wouldn't. There was a crash beside them. A burning wheel always rolls out of flaming wreckage. Two men carrying a large sheet of glass always cross the road in front of any comedy actor involved in a crazy car chase. 
Some narrative conventions are so strong that equivalents happen even on planets where the rocks boil at noon. And when a fully laden table collapses, one miraculously unbroken plate always rolls across the floor and spins to a halt. Susan and the O'God watched it, and then turned their attention to the huge figure now lying in what remained of an enormous centerpiece made of fruit. He just came right out of the air, whispered the O'God. Really? Don't just stand there. Give me a hand to help him up, will you? said Susan, pulling at a large melon. Um, that's a bunch of grapes behind his ear. Well, I don't like even to think about grapes. Oh, come on. Together they managed to get the newcomer onto his feet. Toga, sandals. He looks a bit like you, said Susan, as the fruit victim swayed heavily. Was I that green colour? Close. Uh, is, is there a privy nearby? mumbled their burden through clammy lips. I believe it's through that arch over there, said Susan. I've heard it's not very pleasant, though. That's not a rumour, that's a forecast, said the fat figure and lurched off. And then can I please have a glass of water and one charcoal biscuit? They watched him go. Friend of yours, said Susan. God of indigestion, I think. Look, I, uh, I think I do remember something, said the O-God, just before I, um, incarnated. But it sounds stupid. Well? Teeth, said the O-God. Susan hesitated. You don't mean something attacking you, do you? She said flatly. No, just a sensation of toothiness. Probably doesn't mean much. As God of hangovers, I see a lot worse, I can tell you. Just teeth. Lots of teeth, but not horrible teeth. Just lots and lots of little teeth. Almost sad. Yes. How did you know? Oh, I... Maybe I remember you telling me before you told me. I don't know... How about a big, shiny red globe? The O-God looked thoughtful for a moment and then said, No, can't help you there, I'm afraid. It's just teeth, rows and rows of teeth. I don't remember rows, said Susan. I just felt teeth were important. Nah, it's amazing what you can do with a beak, said the raven, who'd been investigating the laden table and had succeeded in levering a lid off a jar. What have you got there? said Susan wearily. Eyeballs, said the raven. Ah, wizards know how to live all right, eh? They don't want for nothing around here, I can tell you. They're olives, said Susan. Tough luck, said the raven. They're mine now. They're a kind of fruit, or a vegetable or something. You sure? The raven swivelled one doubtful eye on the jar, and the other on her. Yes, the eyes swivelled again. So you're an eyeball expert all of a sudden? Look, they're green, you stupid bird. They could be very old eyeballs, said the raven defiantly. Sometimes they go like that. Squeak, said the death of rats, who was halfway through a cheese. And not so much of the stupid, said the raven. Corvids are exceptionally bright with reasoning, and in the case of some forest species, tool-using abilities. Oh, so you are an expert on ravens, are you? said Susan. Madam, I happen to be a... Squeak, said the death of rats again. They both turned. It was pointing at its grey teeth. The tooth fairy, said Susan. What about her? Squeak! Rows of teeth, said the O-God again. Like, rows, you know. What's the tooth fairy? Oh, you see her around a lot these days, said Susan. Or them, rather. It's a sort of franchise operation. You get the ladder, the money belt and the pliers, and you're set up. Pliers? If she can't make change, she has to take an extra tooth on account. But look, the tooth fairies are harmless enough. I've met one or two of them. They're just working girls. They don't menace anyone. Squeak! I just hope Grandfather doesn't take it into his head to do their job as well. Good grief, the thought of it. They collect teeth? Well, yes, obviously. Why? Why? It's their job. I meant, why, where do they take the teeth after they collect them? I don't know. They just, 
Well, they just take the teeth and leave the money," said Susan. "What sort of a question is that? Where do they take the teeth?" I just wondered. That's all. Probably all humans know. I'm probably very silly for asking. It's probably a well-known fact. Susan looked thoughtfully at the death of rats. Actually, where do they take the teeth? Squeak. He says, "Search him," said the raven. Maybe they sell 'em. It pecked at another jar. How about these? These look nice and wrinkly. Pickled walnuts," said Susan absently. What do they do with the teeth? What use is there for a lot of teeth? But what harm can a tooth fairy do? Have we got time to find one and ask her? Said the O God. Time isn't the problem," said Susan. There are those who believe knowledge is something that is acquired, a precious ore hacked, as it were, from the grey strata of ignorance. There are those who believe that knowledge can only be recalled. That there was some golden age in the distant past when everything was known and the stones fitted together so you could hardly put a knife between them, you know. And it's obvious that they had flying machines, right? Because of the way the earthworks can only be seen from above, yeah. And there's this museum I read about where they found a pocket calculator under the altar of this ancient temple. You know what I'm saying? But the government like hushed it up. It's amazing how good governments are. Given their track record in almost every other field, at hushing up things like alien encounters, one reason may be that the aliens themselves are too embarrassed to talk about it. It's not known why most of the space-going races of the universe want to undertake rummaging in Earthling underwear as a prelude to formal contact, but representatives of several hundred races have taken to hanging out, unsuspected by one another, in rural corners of the planet, and as a result of this, keep on abducting other would-be abductees. Some have been, in fact, abducted while waiting to carry out an abduction on a couple of other aliens trying to abduct the aliens who were, as a result of misunderstood instructions, trying to form cattle into circles and mutilate crops. The planet Earth is now banned to all alien races until they can compare notes and find out how many, if any, real humans they have actually got. It is gloomily suspected that there is only one who is big, hairy, and has very large feet. The truth may be out there, but lies are inside your head. Mustram Ridcully believed that knowledge could be acquired by shouting at people, and was endeavouring to do so. The wizards were sitting around the uncommon room table, which was piled high with books. It is Hogswatch, Arch Chancellor," said the dean reproachfully, thumbing through an ancient volume. "Not until midnight," said Ridcully. "Sorting this out will give you fellows an appetite for your dinner." I think I might have something, Arch Chancellor," said the Chair of Indefinite Studies. "This is Waddley's Basic Gods. There's some stuff here about Lares and Penates that seems to fit the bill." Lares and Penates? What were they when they were at home?" said Ridcully. "Ha ha ha ha!" said the Chair. "What?" said Ridcully. "I thought you were making a rather good joke, Arch Chancellor," said the Chair. "What I?" I didn't mean to," said Ridcully. "Nothing new there," said the dean under his breath. "What was that, dean? Nothing, Arch Chancellor." I thought you made the reference at home because they are, in fact, household gods, or were rather. They seemed to have faded away long ago. They were little spirits of the house, like, for example, three of the other wizards, thinking quite fast for wizards, clapped their hands over his mouth. Careful," said Ridcully. "Careless talk creates lives. That's why we've got a big fat god of indigestion being ill in the privy. By the way, where's the bursar? He was in the privy, Arch Chancellor," said the lecturer in recent runes. "What? When the um? Yes, Arch Chancellor. Oh well, I'm sure he'll be all right," said Ridcully in the matter-of-fact voice of someone contemplating something nasty that was happening to someone else out of earshot. But we don't want any more of these.、Uh, what are they, Chair? Lares and Penates, Arch Chancellor. But I wasn't suggesting. Seems clear to me something's gone wrong, and these little devils are coming back. All we have to do is find out what's gone wrong, and put it right. Oh well, I'm glad that's all sorted out," said the Dean. Household gods," said Ridcully. "That's what they are, Chair." He opened the drawer in his hat and took out his pipe. Yes, Arch Chancellor, 
It says here they used to be the local spirits, I suppose. They saw to it that the bread rose and the butter churned properly. Did they eat pencils? What was their attitude in the socks department? Ah,、uh, this was back in the time of the First Empire," said the chair of indefinite studies. "Sandals and togas and so on. Ah, not noticeably socked. Not excessively so, no. And it was nine hundred years before Osric Pencilium first discovered in the graphite-rich sands of the remote island of Sumtree. The small bush, which by dint of careful cultivation he induced to produce the long, yes, we can all see you've got the encyclopedia open under the table chair," said Ridcully. "But I dare say things have changed a bit, moved with the times, bound to have been a few developments. Hmm? Once they looked after the bread rising, now we have things that eat pencils and socks, and see to it that you can never find a clean towel when you want one." There was a distant tinkling. He stopped. I just said that, didn't I? He said. The wizards nodded glumly, and this is the first time anyone's mentioned it. The wizards nodded again. Well, damn it! It's amazing you can never find a clean towel when you. There was a rising whee noise. A towel went by at shoulder height. There was a suggestion of many small wings. That was mine," said the lecturer in recent runes reproachfully. The towel disappeared in the direction of the great hall. Towel wasps," said the dean. Well done, Arch Chancellor. Well, I mean, damn it! It's human nature, isn't it? Said Ridcully hotly. Things go wrong. Things get lost. It's natural to invent little creatures that. All right, all right. I'll be careful. I'm just saying, man is naturally a mythopoeic creature. What's that mean? Said the senior wrangler. Means we make up things as we go along. Said the dean, not looking up. Um, excuse me, gentlemen," said Ponder Stibbons, who had been scribbling thoughtfully at the end of the table. "Are we suggesting that things are coming back? Do we think that's a viable hypothesis?" The wizards looked at one another around the table. "Definitely viable. Viable, right enough. Yes, that's the stuff to give the troops. What is? What's the stuff to give the troops? Well, tin rations, decent weapons, good boots, that sort of thing." What's that got to do with anything? Don't ask me. He was the one who started talking about giving stuff to the troops. Will you lot shut up? No one's giving anything to the troops. Oh, shouldn't they have something? Oh, it's, it's, it's Hogswatch night after all. Look, it was just a figure of speech. All right, I just meant I was fully in agreement. It's just colourful language. Good grief! You surely can't think I'm actually suggesting giving stuff to the troops at Hogswatch or any other time. You weren't. No, that's a bit mean, isn't it? Ponder just let it happen. It's because their minds are so often involved with deep and problematical matters, he told himself, that their mouths are allowed to wander around, making a nuisance of themselves. I don't hold with using that thinking machine," said the dean. "I've said this before. It's meddling with the cult. The occult has always been good enough for me. Thank you very much. On the other hand, it's the only person round here who can think straight." And it does what it's told," said Ridcully. The sleigh roared through the snow, leaving rolling trails in the sky. "Oh, what fun!" muttered Albert, hanging on tightly. The runners hit a roof near the university, and the pigs trotted to a halt. Death looked at the hourglass again. "Odd," he said. "It's a scythe job, then," said Albert. "You won't be wanting the full speed and the jolly laugh." He looked around, and puzzlement replaced sarcasm. Hey, how could anyone be dead up here? Someone was. A corpse lay in the snow. It was clear that the man had only just died. Albert squinted up at the sky. There's nowhere to fall from, and there's no footprints in the snow. He said as death swung his scythe. So where did he come from? Looks like someone's personal guard, been stabbed to death. Nasty knife wound there. She. Eh,、uh, it's not good," agreed the spirit of the man, looking down at himself. Then he stared from himself to Albert to death, and his phantom expression went from shock to concern. They got the teeth, all of them. They just walked in, and they. No, wait. He faded and was gone. 
Well, what was all that about? said Albert. I have my suspicions. See the badge on his shirt? Looks like a drawing of a tooth. Yes, it does. Where's that come from? A place I cannot go. Albert looked down at the mysterious corpse, and then back up at Death's impassive skull. I keep thinking it was a funny thing us bumping into your granddaughter like that, he said. Yes. Albert put his head on one side. Given the large number of chimneys and kids in the world, etc. Indeed. Amazing coincidence, really. It just goes to show. Hard to believe, you might say. Life certainly springs a few surprises. Not just life, I reckon, said Albert. And she got real worked up, didn't she? Flew right off the old handle. Wouldn't be surprised if she started asking questions. That's people for you. But Rat is hanging around, ain't he? He'll probably keep an eye socket on her. Guide her path, probably. He is a little scamp, isn't he? Albert knew he couldn't win. Death had the ultimate poker face. I'm sure she'll act sensibly. Oh, yeah, said Albert as they walked back to the sleigh. He runs in the family, acting sensibly. Like many barmen, Igor kept a club under the bar to deal with those little upsets that occurred around closing time, although in fact beers never closed and no one could ever remember not seeing Igor behind the bar. Nevertheless, things sometimes got out of hand, or poor, or talon. Igor's weapon of choice was a little different. It was tipped with silver for werewolves, hung with garlic for vampires, and wrapped around with a strip of blanket for bogeymen. For everyone else, the fact that it was two feet of solid bog oak usually sufficed. He'd been watching the window. The frost was creeping across it. For some reason, the creeping fingers were forming into a pattern of three little dogs looking out of a boot. Then someone had tapped him on the shoulder. He spun round, club already in his hand, and relaxed. Oh, it's you, miss. I didn't hear the door. There hadn't been the door. Susan was in a hurry. Have you seen Violet lately, Igor? The tooth girl? Igor's one eyebrow writhed in concentration. Mm, nah, haven't seen her for a week or two. The eyebrow furrowed into a V of annoyance as he spotted the raven, which tried to shuffle behind a half-empty display card of beer nuts. You can get that out of here, miss, he said. You know the rule about pets and familiars. If it can't turn back into human on demand, it's out. Yeah, well, some of us have more brain cells than fingers, muttered a voice from behind the beer nuts. Where does she live? Now, miss, you know I never answers questions like that. Where does she live, Igor? Shamlegger Street next to the picture framers, said Igor automatically. The eyebrow knotted in anger as he realised what he'd said. Now, miss, you know the rules. I don't get bitten, I don't get me throat torn out, and no one hides behind me door, and you don't try your granddad's voice on me. I could ban you for messing me about like that. Sorry, it's important, said Susan. Out of the corner of her eye, she could see that the raven had crept onto the shelves and was pecking the top off a jar. Yeah, well, suppose one of the vampires decides it's important he's missed his tea, grumbled Igor, putting the club away. There was a plink from the direction of the pickled egg jar. Susan tried hard not to look. Can we go, said the O-God. All this alcohol makes me nervous. Susan nodded and hurried out. Igor grunted, then he went back to watching the frost, because Igor never demanded much out of life. After a while, he heard a muffled voice say, I ought one, I ought one. It was indistinct, because the raven had speared a pickled egg with its beak. Igor sighed and picked up his club, and it would have gone very hard for the raven if the death of rats hadn't chosen that moment to bite Igor on the ear. Down there, said Death. The reins were hauled so sharply, so quickly, that the hogs ended up facing the other way. Albert fought his way out of a drift of teddy bears where he'd been dozing. What's up? What's up? Did we hit something? he said. Death pointed downwards. An endless white snowfield lay below, only the occasional glow of a window candle or a half-covered hut indicating the presence on this world of brief mortality. Albert squinted and then saw what Death had spotted. Ah, some old bugger trudging through the snow, he said. 
been gathering wood by the look of it. Bad night to be out, he said, and I'm out in it too, come to that. Look, master, I'm sure you've done enough now to make sure. Something's happening down there, ho, ho, ho. Look, he's all right, said Albert, hanging on as the sleigh tumbled downwards. There was a brief wedge of light below as the wood-gatherer opened the door of a snow-drifted hovel. See over there, there's a couple of blokes catching him up. Look, they're weighed down with parcels and stuff, see? He's going to have a decent hog's watch after all. No problem there. Now, can we go? Death's glowing eye sockets took in the scene in minute detail. It's wrong. Oh, no. Here we go again. The O-God hesitated. What do you mean you can't walk through the door, said Susan? You walked through the door in the bar. That was different. I have certain godlike powers in the presence of alcohol. Anyway, we've knocked and she hasn't answered, and whatever happened to Mr. Manners? Susan shrugged and walked through the cheap woodwork. She knew she probably shouldn't. Every time she did something like this, she used up a certain amount of, well, normal. And sooner or later, she'd forget what doorknobs were for, just like Grandfather. Come to think of it, he'd never found out what doorknobs were for. She opened the door from the inside. The O-God stepped in and looked around. This did not take long. It was not a large room. It had been subdivided from a room that itself hadn't been all that big to start with. This is where the Tooth Fairy lives, Phileas said. It's a bit pokey, isn't it? Stuff all over the floor. What are these things hanging from the line? They are women's clothes, said Susan, rummaging through the paperwork on a small rickety table. They're not very big, said the O-God, and a bit thin. Tell me, said Susan, without looking up, these memories you arrived here with, they weren't very complicated, were they? Ah. He looked over her shoulder as she opened a small red notebook. I've only talked to Violet a few times, she said. I think she delivers the teeth somewhere and gets a percentage of the money. It's not a highly paid line of work. You know, they say you can earn dollars in your spare time. But she says really she could earn more money waiting on tables. Ah, this looks right. What's that? She said she gets given the names every week. What, of the children who are going to lose teeth? Yes, names and addresses, said Susan, flicking through the pages. That doesn't sound very likely. Pardon me, but are you the god of hangovers? Oh, look, here's Twyla's tooth last month. She smiled at the neat grey writing. She practically hammered it out because she needed the half dollar. Do you like children, said the O-God. She gave him a look. Not raw, she said. Other people's are okay. Hold on. She flicked some pages back and forth. There's just blank days, she said. Look, the last few days all unticked, no names. But if you go back a week or two, look, they're all properly marked off and the money added up at the bottom of the page, see? And this can't be right, can it? There were only five names entered on the first unticked night for the previous week. Most children instinctively knew when to push their luck, and only the greedy or dentally improvident called out the tooth fairy around Hogswatch. Read the names, said Susan. William Whittles, a.k.a. Willie, home, Tosser, school, second floor, back bedroom, 68 Kicklebury Street. Sophie Langtree, a.k.a. Daddy's Princess, attic bedroom, 5 The Hippo. The Hon Jeffrey Bibbleton, a.k.a. Trouble in Trousers, Home, Four Eyes, School, First Floor, Back, Scrote Manor, Park Lane. He stopped. I say, this is a bit intrusive, isn't it? It's a whole new world, said Susan. You haven't got there yet. Keep going. New Huckme Iktar, a.k.a. Little Jewel, Basement, The Laughing Falafel, Clatchistan Takeaway and All Night Grocery, Corner, Soak and Dimwell. Reginald Lillywhite, a.k.a. Banjo, The Park Lane Bully, Have You Seen This Man, The Goose Gate Grabber, The Nap Hill Lurker, Room 17, YMPA. YMPA? It's what we generally call the young men's reformed cultists of the Ecor God Bell Shahamroth Association, said Susan. Does that sound to you like someone who'd expect a visit from a tooth fairy? No, me neither. He sounds like someone who'd expect a visit from the watch. Susan looked around. It really was a crummy room. 
the sort rented by someone who probably took it, never intending to stay long, the sort where walking across the floor in the middle of the night would be accompanied by the crack of cockroaches in a death flamenco. It was amazing how many people spent their whole lives in places where they never intended to stay. Cheap, narrow bed, crumbling plaster, tiny window. She opened the window and fished around below the ledge, and felt satisfied when her questing fingers closed on a piece of string which was attached to an oilcloth bag. She hauled it in. What's that? said the O-God as she opened it on the table. Oh, you see them a lot, said Susan, taking out some packages wrapped in second-hand waxed paper. You live alone, mice and roaches eat everything, there's nowhere to store food, but outside the window it's cold and safe. More or less safe. It's an old trick. Now, look at this. Leathery bacon, a green loaf, and a bit of cheese you could shave. She hasn't been back home for some time, believe me. Oh dear, what now? Where would she take the teeth, said Susan, to the world in general, but mainly to herself? What the hell does the tooth fairy do with... There was a knock at the door. Susan opened it. Outside was a small, bald man in a long brown coat. He was holding a clipboard and blinked nervously at the sight of her. Er, uh, he began. Can I help you? said Susan. Er, uh, I saw the light, see. Er, uh, I thought a violet was in, said the little man. He twiddled the pencil that was attached to his clipboard by a piece of string. Only she's a bit behind with the teeth, and there's a bit of money owing, and Ernie's cart ain't come back, and it's got to go in my report, and I come round in case... In case she was ill or something, it not being nice being alone and ill at Hogswatch. She's not here, said Susan. The man gave her a worried look and shook his head sadly. There's nearly thirteen dollars in pillow money, see? I'll have to report it. Who to? Has to go higher up, see? I just hope it's not going to be like that business in Querm, where the girl started robbing houses. We never heard the end of that one. Report to who? And there's the ladder and the pliers, the man went on in a litany against a world that had no understanding of what it meant to have to fill in an AF-17 report in triplicate. How can I keep track of stock-taking if people go around taking stock? He shook his head. I don't know. They get the job, they think it's all nice sunny nights. They get a bit of sharp weather and suddenly it's, Goodbye, Charlie, I'm off to be a waitress in the warm. And then there's Ernie, I know him. "'to nip to keep out the cold, and then another one to keep it company, "'and then a third in case the other two get lost. <laughs> "'It's all going to have to go down in my report, you know. "'And who's going to get the blame? I'll tell you.' "'It's going to be you, isn't it?' said Susan. "'She was almost hypnotised. "'The man even had a fringe of worried hair and a small worried moustache, "'and the voice suggested exactly that here was a man "'who at the end of the world would worry that it would be blamed on him. "'That's right,' he said but in a slightly grudging voice. He was not about to allow a bit of understanding to lighten his day. And the girls all go on about the job, but I tell them they've got it easy. It's just basically ladder work. They don't have to spend their evenings knee-deep in paper and making shortfalls good out of their own money, I might add. You employ the tooth fairies, said Susan quickly. The O-God was still vertical, but his eyes had glazed over. The little man preened slightly. Sort of, he said. Basically, I run bulk collection and dispatch. Where to? He stared at her. Sharp, direct questions weren't his forte. I just sees to it. They gets on the cart, he mumbled. When they're on the cart and Ernie signed the GV-19 for them, that's it done and finished. Only like I said, he ain't turned up this week, and... A whole cart for a handful of teeth? Well, there's the food for the guards, and... Here, who are you, anyway? What are you doing here? Susan straightened up. I don't have to put up with this, she said sweetly, to no one in particular. She leaned forward again. What cart are we talking about here, Charlie? The O-God jolted away. The man in the brown coat shot backwards and splayed against the corridor wall as Susan advanced. "'Comes Tuesdays,' he panted. "'Here, what?' "'And where does it go?' "'Dunno. You know, like I said, it's when he's... "'Signed the GV-19 for them. "'It's you done and finished,' said Susan, in her normal voice. "'Yes, you said. "'What's Violet's full name? "'She never mentioned it.' 
The man hesitated. I said... Violet Butler. Thank you. And Ernie's gone too, said Charlie, continuing more or less on autopilot. I call that suspicious. I mean, he's got a wife and everything. Won't be the first man to get his head turned by thirteen dollars and a pretty ankle. And, of course, no one thinks about muggins who has to carry the can. I mean, supposing we was all to get it in our heads to run off with young women. He gave Susan the stern look of one who if it was not for the fact that the world needed him, would even now be tiring of painting naked young ladies on some tropical island somewhere. "'What happens to the teeth?' said Susan. He blinked at her. "'A bully,' thought Susan. "'A very small, weak, very dull bully, who doesn't manage any real bullying because there's hardly anyone smaller and weaker than him, so he just makes everyone's lives just that little bit more difficult.' "'What sort of a question is that?' he managed, in the face of her stare. "'You never wondered?' said Susan, and added to herself, "'I didn't, did anyone?' "'Well, it's not my job. I just—' "'Oh, yes, you said,' said Susan. "'Thank you. You've been very helpful. Thank you very much.' The man stared at her, and then turned and ran down the stairs. Drat, said Susan. "'That's a very unusual swear word,' said the O-God nervously. It's so easy, said Susan. If I want to, I can find anybody. It's a family trait. Oh, good. No. Have you any idea how hard it is to be normal? The things you have to remember. How to go to sleep. How to forget things. What doorknobs are for. Why ask him, she thought, as she looked at his shocked face. All that's normal for him is remembering to throw up what someone else drank. Oh, come on, she said, and hurried towards the stairs. It was so easy to slip into immortality, to ride the horse, to know everything. And every time you did, it brought closer the day when you could never get off and never forget. Death was hereditary. You got it from your ancestors. Where are we going now? said the O-God. Down to the YMPA, said Susan. The old man in the hovel looked uncertainly at the feast spread in front of him. He sat on his stool, as curled up on himself, as a spider in a flame. Oh, he'd got a bit of a mess of beans cooking, he mumbled, looking at his visitors through filmy eyes. Good heavens, you can't eat beans at Hogswatch, said the king, smiling hugely. That's terribly unlucky, eating beans at Hogswatch, my word, yes. Didn't know that, the old man said, looking down desperately at his lap. We've brought you this magnificent spread, don't you think so? I bet you're incredibly grateful for it, too, said the page sharply. Yeah, well, of course, it's very kind of you, gentlemen, said the old man in a voice the size of a mouse. He blinked, uncertain of what to do next. The turkey's hardly been touched. Still plenty of meat on it, said the king, and do have some of this cracking good widgeon stuffed with swan's liver. Only I'm partial to a bowl of beans that I've never been beholden to no one or nobody, the old man said, staring at his lap. "'Good heavens, man, you don't need to worry about that,' said the king heartily. "'It's Hogswatch. I was only just now looking out of the window, and I saw you plodding through the snow, and I said to young Germain here, I said, "'Who's that chappie?' And he said, "'Oh, he's some peasant fellow who lives up by the forest,' and I said, "'Well, I couldn't eat another thing, and it's Hogswatch after all, and so we just bungled everything up, and here we are.' "'And I expect you're pathetically thankful,' said the page. "'I expect we've brought a ray of light into your dark tunnel of a life, hm?' "'Yes, well, of course. Only I'd been saving them for weeks, see, and there's some bacon potatoes under the fire. I found them in the cellar, and the mice hardly touched them.' The old man never raised his eyes from knee level. "'And our dad brought me up never to ask for—' "'Listen!' said the king, raising his voice a little. I've walked miles tonight, and I bet you've never seen food like this in your whole life, huh? Tears of humiliated embarrassment were rolling down the old man's face. Well, I'm sure it's very kind of you fine gentlemen, but I ain't sure I knows how to eat swans and such like. But if you want a bit of my beans, you've only got to say. Let me make myself absolutely clear, said the king sharply. This is some genuine Hogs Watch charity, do you understand? And we're going to sit here and watch the smile on your grubby but honest face. Is that understood? Hend, what do you say to the good king? 
the page prompted. The peasant hung his head. Thank you. Right, said the king, sitting back. Now, pick up your fork. The door burst open. An indistinct figure strode into the room, snow swirling around it in a cloud. What's going on here? The page started to stand up, drawing his sword. He never worked out how the other figure could have got behind him, but there it was, pressing him gently down again. Hello, son. My name is Albert, said a voice by his ear. Why don't you put that sword back very slowly? People might get hurt. A finger prodded the king, who had been too shocked to move. What do you think you are doing, sire? The king tried to focus on the figure. There was an impression of red and white, but black, too. To Albert's secret amazement, the man managed to get to his feet and draw himself up as regally as he could. What is going on here, whoever you are, is some fine old Hogswatch charity, and who— No, it's not. What? How dare you? Were you here last month? Will you be here next week? No. But tonight you wanted to feel all warm inside. Tonight you will— Want them to say what a good king he is? Oh no, he's going too far again," muttered Albert under his breath. He pushed the page down again. "No, you stay still, Sonny. Else you'll just be a paragraph." Whatever it is, it's more than he's got," snapped the king. "And all we've had from him is ingratitude." Yes, that does spoil it, doesn't it? Death leaned forward. Go away. To the king's own surprise, his body took over and marched him out of the door. Albert patted the page on the shoulder. "And you can run along too," he said. "I didn't mean to go upsetting anyone. It's just that I never asked no one for nothing," mumbled the old man in a small, humble world of his own, his hands tangling themselves together out of nervousness. "Best if you leave this one to me, master, if you don't mind," said Albert. "I'll be back in just a tick." "Loose ends," he thought. "That's my job, tying up loose ends." The master never thinks things through. He caught up with the king outside. Ah, there you are, sire. He said, "Just before you go, won't keep you a minute. Just a minor point." Albert leaned close to the stunned monarch. If anyone was thinking about making a mistake, you know, like maybe sending the guards down here tomorrow, tipping the old man out of his hovel, chucking him in prison, anything like that, well, that's the kind of mistake he ought to treasure on account of it being the last mistake he'll ever make. A word to the wise men, right? He tapped the side of his nose conspiratorially. Happy Hogs Watch. Then he hurried back into the hovel. The feast had vanished. The old man was looking blearily at the bare table. Half-eaten leavings," said Death. "We could certainly do better than this." He reached into the sack. Albert grabbed his arm before he could withdraw his hand. "Mind taking a bit of advice, Master? I was brung up in a place like this." Does it bring tears to your eyes? A box of matches to me hand, more like. Listen, the old man was only dimly aware of some whispering. He sat hunched up, staring at nothing. Well, if you are sure. Been there, done that, chewed the bones," said Albert. Charity ain't giving people what you wants to give; it's giving people what they need to get. Very well. Death reached into the sack again. Happy Hogs Watch! Ho ho ho! There was a string of sausages. There was a side of bacon. And a small tub of salt pork, and a mass of chitterlings wrapped up in greased paper. There was a black pudding. There were several other tubs of disgusting yet savoury pork-adjacent items, highly prized in any pig-based economy, and laid on the table with a soft thump. There was a pig's head. Breathed the old man. A whole one. Ain't had brawn in years, and a basin of pig knuckles, and a bowl of pork dripping. Ho ho ho. Amazing," said Albert. "How did you get the hedge expression to look like the king?" "I think that's accidental." Albert patted the old man on the back. "Have yourself a ball," he said. "In fact, have two. Now I think we ought to be going, master." They left the old man staring at the laden board. "Wasn't that nice?" said Death as the hogs accelerated. "Oh yes," said Albert, shaking his head. "Poor old devil." Beans at Hogwatch. Unlucky that. Not a night for a man to find a bean in his bowl. I feel I was cut out for this sort of thing, you know. Really, Master? It's nice to do a job where people look forward to seeing you. Ah," said Albert glumly. They don't normally look forward to seeing me. Yes, I expect so. 
except in special and rather unfortunate circumstances. Right, right. And they seldom leave a glass of sherry out. I expect they don't know. I could get into the habit of doing this, in fact. But you won't need to, will you, Master? said Albert hurriedly, with the horrible prospect of being a permanent pixie Albert looming in his mind again. Because we'll get the Hogfather back, right? That's what you said we were going to do, right? And young Susan's probably bustling around? Yes, of course. Not that you asked her to, of course. Albert's jittery ears didn't detect any enthusiasm. Oh dear, he thought. I have always chosen the path of duty. Right, master. The sleigh sped on. I am thoroughly in control and firm of purpose. No problem there then, master, said Albert. No need to worry at all. Pleased to hear it, master. If I had a first name, duty would be my middle name. Good. Nevertheless, Albert strained his ears and thought he heard just on the edge of hearing a voice whisper sadly. Ho, ho, ho. There was a party going on. It seemed to occupy the entire building. Certainly very energetic young men, said the O-God carefully, stepping over a wet towel. Are women allowed in here? No, said Susan. She stepped through a wall into the superintendent's office. A group of young men went past, manhandling a barrel of beer. You'll feel bad about it in the morning, said Billius. Strong drink is a mocker, you know. They set it up on a table and knocked out the bung. Someone's going to have to be sick after all that, he said, raising his voice above the hubbub. I hope you realise that. You think it's clever, do you, reducing yourself to the level of the beasts of the field? Or the level they'd sink to if they drank, I mean. They moved away, leaving one mug of beer by the barrel. The O-God glanced at it and picked it up and sniffed it. Ugh! Susan stepped out of the wall. He hasn't been back for... What are you doing? I thought I'd see what beer tastes like, said the O-God guiltily. You don't know what beer tastes like? Not on the way down, no. It's quite different by the time it gets to me, he said sourly. He took another sip and then a longer one. I can't see what all the fuss is about, he added. He tipped up the empty pot. I suppose it comes out of this tap here, he said. You know, for once in my existence, I'd like to get drunk. Aren't you always, said Susan, who wasn't really paying attention. No, I've always been drunk. I'm sure I explained. He's been gone a couple of days, said Susan. That's odd, and he didn't say where he was going. The last night he was here was the night he was on Violet's list, but he paid for his room for the week, and I've got the number. And the key, said the O-God. What a strange idea. Mr. Lillywhite's room was small. That wasn't surprising. What was surprising was how neat it was, how carefully the little bed had been made, how well the floor had been swept. It was hard to imagine anyone living in it, but there were a few signs. On the simple table by the bed was a small, rather crude portrait of a bulldog in a wig, although on closer inspection it might have been a woman. This tentative hypothesis was borne out by the inscription To a good boy from his mother on the back. A book lay next to it. Susan wondered what kind of reading someone with Mr. Banjo's background would buy. It turned out to be a book of six pages, one of those that were supposed to enthrall children with the magic of the printed word by pointing out that they could see, spot, run. There were no more than ten words on each page, and yet carefully placed between pages four and five was a bookmark. She turned back to the cover. The book was called Happy Tales. There was a blue sky and trees and a couple of impossibly pink children playing with a jolly-looking dog. It looked as though it had been read frequently, if slowly. And that was it. A dead end. No, perhaps not. On the floor, by the bed, as if it had been accidentally dropped, was a small, silvery half-dollar piece. Susan picked it up and tossed it idly. She looked the O-God up and down. He was swilling a mouthful of beer from cheek to cheek and looking thoughtfully at the ceiling. She wondered about his likelihood of survival incarnate in Unc Morpork at Hogswatch, especially if the cure wore off. After all, the only purpose of his existence was to have a headache and throw up. There were not a great many postgraduate jobs for which these were the main qualifications. Tell me, she said, have you ever ridden a horse? I don't know. What's a horse?
in the depths of the library of death. A squeaking noise. It was not loud, but it appeared louder than mere decibels would suggest in the furtive, scribbling hush of the books. Everyone, it is said, has a book inside them. In this library, everyone was inside a book. The squeaking got louder. It had a rhythmical, circular quality. Book on book, shelf on shelf, and in every one, at the page of the ever-moving now, a scribble of handwriting following the narrative of every life. The squeaking came round the corner. It was issuing from what looked like a very rickety edifice several stories high. It looked rather like a siege tower, open at the sides. At the base, between the wheels, was a pair of geared treadles which moved the whole thing. Susan clung to the railing of the topmost platform. Can't you hurry up? she said. We're only at the bees at the moment. I've been peddling for ages, panted the O-God. Well, A is a very popular letter. Susan stared up at the shelves. A was for a non, among other things. All those people who for one reason or another never officially got a name. They tended to be short books. Ah, bow, bod, bog, turn left. The library tower squeaked ponderously around the next corner. Ah, bow, blast, the bots are at least twenty shelves up. Oh, how nice, said the O-God grimly. He heaved on the lever that moved the drive chain from one sprocket to another, and started to pedal again. Very ponderously, the creaking tower began to telescope upwards. Right, we're there, Susan shouted down after a few minutes of slow rise. Here, let's see. Arbana Bottler. I expect Violet will be a lot further, said the O-God, trying out irony. Onwards! Swaying a little, the tower headed down the bees until... Stop! It rocked as the O-God kicked the brake block against a wheel. I think this is her, said a voice from above. OK, you can lower away. A big wheel with ponderous lead weights on it spun slowly as the tower concertinaed back, creaking and grinding. Susan climbed down the last few feet. Everyone's in here, said the O-God as she thumbed through the pages. Yes, even gods. Anything that's alive and self-aware, said Susan, not looking up. This is odd. It looks as though she's in some sort of prison. Who'd want to lock up a tooth fairy? Someone with very sensitive teeth? Susan flicked back a few pages. It's all hoods over her head and people carrying her and so on. But she turned a page. It says the last job she did was on banjo, and yes, she got the tooth, and then she felt as though someone was behind her, and there's a ride on a cart, and the hood's come off, and there's a causeway, and all that's in a book. The autobiography. Everyone has one. It writes down your life as you go along. I've got one. I expect so. Oh, dear. Got up, was sick, wanted to die. Not a gripping read, really. Susan turned the page. A tower, she said. She's in a tower. From what she saw, it was tall and white inside, but not outside. It didn't look real. There were apple trees around it, but the trees, the trees didn't look right. And a river, but that wasn't right either. There were goldfish in it, but they were on top of the water. Ah, pollution, said the O-God. I don't think so. It says here she saw them swimming. Swimming on top of the water? That's how she thinks she saw it. Really? You don't think she's been eating any of that mouldy cheese, do you? And there was a blue sky, but she must have got this wrong. It says here there was only blue sky above. Yeah, best place for the sky, said the O-God. Sky underneath you, that probably means trouble. Susan flicked a page back and forth. She means sky overhead, but not around the edges, I think. No sky on the horizon. Excuse me, said the O-God. I'm not long in this world, I appreciate that. But I think you have to have sky on the horizon. Uh, that's how you can tell it's the horizon. A sense of familiarity was creeping up on Susan, but surreptitiously, dodging behind things whenever she tried to concentrate on it. I've seen this place, she said, tapping the page. If only she'd looked harder at the trees. She says they've got brown trunks and green leaves, and it says here she thought they were odd, and... She concentrated on the next paragraph. Flowers growing in the grass with big round petals. 
She stared, unseeing, at the O-God again. This isn't a proper landscape, she said. Doesn't sound too unreal to me, said the O-God. Sky, trees, flowers, dead fish. Brown tree trunks. Really, they're mostly a sort of greyish, mossy colour. You only ever see brown tree trunks in one place, said Susan, and it's the same place where the sky is only ever overhead. The blue never comes down to the ground. She looked up. At the far end of the corridor was one of the very tall, very thin windows. It looked out onto the black gardens. Black bushes, black grass, black trees. Skeletal fish cruising in the black waters of a pool under black water lilies. There was colour, in a sense, but it was the kind of colour you'd get if you could shine a beam of black through a prism. There were hints of tints here and there, a black you might persuade yourself was a very deep purple or a midnight blue. But it was, basically, black, under a black sky, because this was the world belonging to death, and that was all there was to it. The shape of death was the shape people had created for him over the centuries. Why bony? Because bones were associated with death. He'd got a scythe because agricultural people could spot a decent metaphor. And he lived in a sombre land because the human imagination would be rather stretched to let him live somewhere nice with flowers. People like Death lived in the human imagination and got their shape there too. He wasn't the only one. But he didn't like the script, did he? He'd started to take an interest in people. Was that a thought or just a memory of something that hadn't happened yet? The O-God followed her gaze. Can we go after her? said the O-God. I say we. I think I've just got drafted in because I was in the wrong place. She's alive. That means she is mortal, said Susan. That means I can find her, too. She turned and started to walk out of the library. If she says the sky is just blue overhead, what's between it and the horizon? said the O-God, running to keep up. You don't have to come, said Susan. It's not your problem. Yes. But given that my problem is that my whole purpose in life is to feel rotten, anything's an improvement. It could be dangerous. I don't think she's there of her own free will. Would you be any good in a fight? Yes, I could be sick on people. It was a shack somewhere on the outskirts of the plains town of Scrote. Scrote had a lot of outskirts, spread so widely, a busted cart here, a dead dog there, that often people went through it without even knowing it was there. And really, it only appeared on the maps because cartographers get embarrassed about big empty spaces. Hogswatch came after the excitement of the cabbage harvest, when it was pretty quiet in Scrote, and there was nothing much to look forward to until the fun of the Sprout Festival. This shack had an iron stove with a pipe that went up through the thick cabbage leaf thatch. Voices echoed faintly within the pipe. This is really, really stupid. I think the tradition got started when everyone had them big chimneys, Master. This voice sounded as though it was coming from someone standing on the roof and shouting down the pipe. Indeed, it's only a mercy it's unlit. There was some muffled scratching and banging, and then a thump from within the pot belly of the stove. Damn! What's up, Master? The door has no handle on the inside. I call that inconsiderate. There were some more bumps, and then a scrape as the stove lid was lifted up and pushed sideways. An arm came out and felt around the front of the stove until it found the handle. It played with it for a while, but it was obvious that the hand did not belong to a person used to opening things. In short, death came out of the stove. Exactly how would be difficult to describe without folding the page. Time and space were, from death's point of view, merely things that he'd heard described. When it came to death, they ticked the box marked, Not Applicable. It might help to think of the universe as a rubber sheet, or perhaps not. Let us in, master, a pitiful voice echoed down from the roof. It's brass monkeys out here. Death went over to the door. Snow was blowing underneath it. He peered nervously at the woodwork. There was a thump outside, and Albert's voice sounded a lot closer. What's up, master? Death stuck his head through the wood of the door. There's these metal things. Bolts, master, you slide them said Albert, sticking his hands under his armpits to keep them warm. Ah! Death's head disappeared. Albert stamped his feet and watched his breath cloud in the air while he listened to the pathetic scrabbling on the other side of the door. Death's head appeared again. Um... It's the latch, master, 
said Albert wearily. Right, right. You put your thumb on it and push it down. Right. The head disappeared. Albert jumped up and down a bit and waited. The head appeared. Uh, I was with you up to the thumb. Albert sighed. And then you press down and pull, master. Ah, right. Got you. The head disappeared. Oh dear, thought Albert. He just can't get the hang of them, can he? The door jerked open. Death stood behind it, beaming proudly as Albert staggered in, snow blowing in with him. Blimey, it's getting really parky," said Albert. "Any sherry?" he added hopefully. "It appears not." Death looked at the sock hooked onto the side of the stove. It had a hole in it. A letter in erratic handwriting was attached to it. Death picked it up. The boy wants a pair of trousers that he doesn't have to share, a huge meat pie, a sugar mouse, a lot of toys, and a puppy called Scruff. Oh, sweet," said Albert. "I shall wipe away a tear, 'cause what he's getting, see, is this little wooden toy and an apple." He held them out. But the letter clearly. Yes, well, it's socio-economic factors again, right? Said Albert. The world would be in a right mess if everyone got what they asked for, eh? I gave them what they wanted in the store. Yeah, and that's going to cause a lot of trouble, Master. All them toy pigs that really work. I didn't say nothing 'cause it was getting the job done, but you can't go on like that. What good's a god who gives you everything you want? You have me there. It's the hope that's important. Big part of belief, hope. Give people jam today, and they'll just sit and eat it. Jam tomorrow. Now that'll keep them going forever. And you mean that because of this, the poor get poor things, and the rich get rich things? That's right," said Albert. "That's the meaning of Hog's Watch." Death nearly wailed. "But I'm the Hog Father." He looked embarrassed. At the moment, I mean. Makes no difference," said Albert, shrugging. "I remember when I was a nipper. One Hog's Watch, I had my heart set on this huge model horse they had in the shop." His face creased for a moment in a grim smile of recollection. I remember I spent hours one day, cold as charity the weather was. I spent hours with my nose pressed up against the window until they heard me calling and unfroze me. I saw them take it out the window. Someone was in there buying it, and you know, just for a second, I thought it really was going to be for me. Oh, I dreamed of that toy horse. It were red and white. With a real saddle and everything, and rockers, I'd have killed for that horse. He shrugged again. Not a chance, of course, 'cause we didn't have a pot to piss in, and we even had to spit on the bread to make it soft enough to eat. Please enlighten me. What is so important about having a pot to piss in? It's it's more like a figure of speech, master. It means you're as poor as a church mouse. Are they poor? Well, yeah, but surely not more poor than any other mouse. And after all, there tend to be lots of candles and things they could eat. It's a figure of speech again, master. It doesn't have to make sense. Oh, I see. Do carry on. Of course, I still hung up my stocking on Ogg's Watch Eve. In the morning, you know, you know what? Our dad had put in this little horse. He'd carved his very own self. Ah," said Death, "and that was worth more than all the expensive toy horses in the world, eh?" Albert gave him a beady look. "No," he said, "it weren't. All I could think of was it wasn't the big horse in the window." Death looked shocked. "But how much better to have a toy carved with?" "No, only grown-ups think like that," said Albert. "You're a selfish little bugger when you're seven." Anyway, Dad got ratted after lunch and trod on it. Lunch? All right, maybe we had a bit of pork dripping for the bread. Even so, the spirit of Hogs Watch. Albert sighed. If you like, Master. If you like. Death looked perturbed. But supposing the Hog Father had brought you the wonderful horse? Ah, Dad would have flogged it for a couple of bottles," said Albert. 
but we have been into houses where the children had many toys, and brought them even more toys, and in houses like this the children get practically nothing. Huh? We'd have given anything to get practically nothing when I were a lad, said Albert. Be happy with what you've got. Is that the idea? That's about the size of it, master. A good god line, that. Don't give them too much, and tell them to be happy with it. Jam tomorrow. See? This is wrong, Death hesitated. I mean, it's right to be happy with what you've got, but you've got to have something to be happy about having. There's no point in being happy about having nothing. Albert felt a bit out of his depth in this new tide of social philosophy. Dunno, he said. I suppose people would say they've got the moon and the stars and such like. I'm sure they wouldn't be able to produce the paperwork. All I know is, if Dad had caught us with a big bag of pricey toys, we'd have just got a ding round the ear hole for nicking him. It is unfair. That's life, Master. But I'm not. I meant this is how it's supposed to go, Master, said Albert. No, you mean this is how it goes. Albert leaned against the stove and rolled himself one of his horrible thin cigarettes. It was best to let the master work his own way through these things. He got over them eventually. It was like that business with the violin. For three days there was nothing but twangs and broken strings, and then he'd never touch the thing again. That was the trouble, really. Everything the master did was a bit like that. When things got into his head, you just had to wait until they leaked out again. He'd thought that Hogswatch was all plum pudding and brandy and ho-ho-ho, and he didn't have the kind of mind that could ignore all the other stuff. And so it hurt him. It is Hogswatch, said Death, and people die on the streets. People feast behind lighted windows, and other people have no homes. Is this fair? Well, of course. That's the big issue, Albert began. The peasant had a handful of beans, and the king had so much he would not even notice that which he gave away. Is this fair? Yeah, but if you gave it all to the peasant, then in a year or two he'd be just as snooty as the king, began Albert, jaundiced observer of human nature. Naughty and nice, said Death, but it's easy to be nice if you're rich. Is this fair? Albert wanted to argue. He wanted to say, really? In that case, how come so many of the rich buggers is bastards? And being poor don't mean being naughty, neither. We was poor when I were a kid, but we was honest. Well, more stupid than honest, to tell the truth, but basically honest. He didn't argue, though. The master wasn't in any mood for it. He always did what needed to be done. You did say we just had to do this so's people would believe, he began, and then stopped and started again. When it comes to fair, master... You yourself? I am even-handed to rich and poor alike, snapped Death. But this should not be a sad time. This is supposed to be the season to be jolly. He wrapped his red robe around him. And other things ending in Ollie, he added. There's no blade, said the O-God. It's just a sword hilt. Susan stepped out of the light and her wrist moved. A sparkling blue line flashed in the air for a moment, outlining an edge too thin to be seen. The O-God backed away. What's that? Oh, it cuts tiny bits of the air in half. It can cut the soul away from the body, so stand back, please. Oh, I will, I will. Susan fished the black scabbard out of the umbrella stand. Umbrella stand? It never rained here, but death had an umbrella stand. Practically no one else Susan knew had an umbrella stand. In any list of useful furniture, the one found at the bottom would be the umbrella stand. Death lived in a black world where nothing was alive and everything was dark, and his great library only had dust and cobwebs because he'd created them for effect, and there was never any sun in the sky, and the air never moved, and he had an umbrella stand, and a pair of silver-backed hairbrushes by his bed. He wanted to be something more than just a bony apparition. He tried to create these flashes of personality, but somehow they betrayed themselves. They tried too hard, like an adolescent boy going out wearing an aftershave called Rampant. Grandfather always got things wrong. He saw life from outside and never quite understood. That looks dangerous, said the O-God. Susan sheathed the sword. I hope so, she said. Um, where are we going, exactly? 
"'Somewhere under an overhead sky,' said Susan. "'And I've seen it before. "'Recently. "'I know the place.' "'They walked out to the stable-yard. "'Binky was waiting. "'I said you don't have to come,' said Susan, grasping the saddle. "'I mean you're a... an innocent bystander.' "'But I'm a god of hangovers who's been cured of hangovers,' said the O-God. "'I haven't really got any function at all.' "'He looked so forlorn when he said this that she relented. "'All right, come on, then.' "'She pulled him up behind her. "'Just hang on,' she said. "'And then she said, "'Hang on somewhere differently, I mean.' "'I'm sorry, was that a problem?' said the O-God, shifting his grip. "'It might take too long to explain, and you probably don't know all the words. "'Around the waist, please.' Susan took out Violet's hourglass and held it up. There was a lot of sand left to run, but she couldn't be certain that that was a good sign. All she could be certain of was that the horse of death could go anywhere. The sound of Hex's quill as it scrabbled across the paper was like a frantic spider trapped in a matchbox. Despite his dislike of what was going on, there was a part of Ponder Stibbons that was very, very impressed. In the past, when Hex had been recalcitrant about its calculations... When it had got into a mechanical sulk and had started writing things like plus, 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 out of cheese, error, plus, 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 and plus, 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 redo from start, plus, 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 Ponder had tried to sort things out calmly and logically. It had never, ever occurred to him to contemplate hitting Hex with a mallet, but this was, in fact, what Ridcully was threatening to do. What was impressive, and also more than a little worrying, was that Hex seemed to understand the concept. Right! said Ridcully, putting the mallet aside. Let's have no more of this insufficient dates business, shall we? There's boxes of the damn things back in the Great Hall. You can have the lot, as far as I'm concerned. It's data, not dates, said Ponder helpfully. What? You mean, like, more than dates? Extra sticky? No, no, data is Hex's word for, uh, well, facts, said Ponder. "'Ridiculous way to behave,' said Ridcully, brusquely. "'If he's stumped for an answer, why can't he write, "'You've got me there,' or "'Damned if I know,' or "'That's a bit of a puzzler and no mistake. "'All this insufficient data business is just pure contrariness to my mind. Mm -hmm. "'It's just swank,' he turned back to Hex. "'Right, you. Hazard a guess.' "'The quill started to write, plus, 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 insuffi and then stopped. After quivering for a moment, it went down a line and started again. Plus, 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 this is just calculating aloud, you understand. Plus, plus, plus. Fair enough, said Ridcully. Plus, 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 the amount of belief in the world must be subject to an upper limit. Plus, plus, plus. What an odd question, said the dean. Sounds sensible, said Ridcully. I suppose people just believe in stuff. Obviously there's a limit to what you can believe in. I've always said so. So what? Plus, plus, plus. Creatures have appeared that were once believed in. Plus, plus, plus. Yes, yes, you could put it like that. Plus, plus, plus. They disappeared because they were not believed in. Plus, plus, plus. Seems reasonable, said Ridcully. Plus, plus, plus. People were believing in something else, dash, query. Plus, plus, plus. Ridcully looked at the other wizards. They shrugged. Could be, he said guardedly. People can only believe in so many things. Plus, plus, plus. It follows that if a major focus of belief is removed, there will be spare belief. Plus, plus, plus. Ridcully stared at the words. You mean sloshing around? The big wheel with the ram skulls on it began to turn ponderously. The scurrying ants in the glass tubes took on a new urgency. "'What's happening?' said Ridcully in a loud whisper. "'I think Hex is looking up the word sloshing,' said Ponder. "'It may be in long-term storage.' A large hourglass came down on the spring. "'What's that for?' said Ridcully. "'Er, uh, it shows Hex is working things out.' "'Oh, and that buzzing noise seems to be coming from the other side of the wall,' Ponder coughed. That is the long-term storage, Arch-Chancellor. And uh, how does that work? Uh, well, if you think of memory as a series of little shelves or, 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 or holes, Arch-Chancellor, in which you can put things, well, we found a way of making a sort of memory which uh, interfaces neatly with the ants. 
in fact, but more importantly can expand its size depending on how much we give it to remember and uh, is probably a bit slow, but... It's a very loud buzzing, said the dean. Is it going wrong? No, that shows it's working, said Ponder. It's, uh, beehives, he coughed. Different types of pollen, different thicknesses of honey, placement of the eggs. It's actually amazing how much information you can store on one honeycomb. He looked at their faces. And it's very secure because anyone trying to tamper with it will get stung to death. And Adrian believes that when we shut it down in the summer holidays, we should get a nice lot of honey too. He coughed again. For our sandwiches, he said. He felt himself getting smaller and hotter under their gazes. Hex came to his rescue. The hourglass bounced away, and the quill pen was jerked in and out of its inkwell. Plus, plus, plus. Yes. Sloshing around. Accreting. Plus, plus, plus. That means forming around new centres, Arch-Chancellor, said Ponder helpfully. I know that, said Ridcully. Blast. Remember when we had all that life force all over the place? A man couldn't call his trousers his own. So, the spare belief sloshing around. Thank you. And these little devils are taking advantage of it. Coming back, hmm? Household gods? Plus, plus, plus. This is possible. Plus, plus, plus. All right, then. So what are people not believing in all of a sudden? Plus, plus, plus. Out of cheese error. Plus, plus, plus. Melon, melon, melon. Plus, plus, plus. Redo from start. Plus, plus, plus. Thank you. A simple I don't know would have been sufficient, said Ridcully, sitting back. One of the major gods, said the chair of indefinite studies. <laughs> We'd soon know about it if one of those vanished. It's Hog's Watch, said the dean. I suppose the Hogfather is around, is he? You believe in him, said Ridcully. Well, he's for kids, isn't he, said the dean. But I'm sure they all believe in him. I certainly did. It wouldn't be Hog's Watch when I was a kid without pillowcase hanging by the fire. Er, uh, pillowcase, said the senior wrangler sharply. Well, you can't get much in a stocking, said the dean. Yes, but, er, uh, a whole pillowcase, the senior wrangler insisted. Yes, what of it? Is it just me, or is that a rather greedy and selfish way to behave? In my family we just hung up very small socks, said the senior wrangler. A sugar pig, a toy soldier, a couple of oranges, and that was it. Eh, turns out people with whole pillowcases were cornering the market, hmm? Shut up and stop squabbling, both of you, said Ridcully. There must be a simple way to check up. How can you tell if the Hogfather exists? Someone's drunk the sherry, there's sooty footprints on the carpet, sleigh tracks on the roof, and your pillowcase is full of presents, said the dean. Ah, uh -huh. pillowcase, said the senior wrangler darkly. Ah, I expect your family with a stuck-up sort that didn't even open their presents until after Hog's Watch dinner. Hmm? <laughs> One of them with a big snooty Hog's Watch tree in the hall. What if... Ridcully began, but he was too late. Well, said the dean, of course we waited until after lunch. You know, it really used to wind me right up, people with big snooty hogswatch trees. And I just bet you had one of those swanky, fancy nutcrackers like a big thumbscrew, said the senior wrangler. Some people had to make do with the coal hammer out of the outhouse, of course, and had dinner in the middle of the day instead of la -de da posh dinner in the evening. I can't help it if my family had money, said the dean and that might have diffused things a bit, had he not added, and standards. And big pillowcases, shouted the senior wrangler, bouncing up and down in rage, and I bet you bought your holly, eh? The dean raised his eyebrows. Of course, we didn't go creeping around the country, pinching it out of other people's hedges like some people did, he snapped. That's traditional, that's part of the fun. Celebrating Hogswatch with stolen greenery... Ridcully put his hands over his eyes. The word for this, he had heard, was cabin fever. When people had been cooped up for too long in the dark days of the winter, they always tended to get on one another's nerves, although there was probably a school of thought that would hold that spending your time in a university with more than 5,000 known rooms, a huge library, 
the best kitchens in the city, its own brewery, dairy, extensive wine cellar, laundry, barber shop, cloisters, and skittle alley, was testing the definition of cooped up a little. Mind you, wizards could get on one another's nerves in opposite corners of a very large field. Just shut up, will you? He said. It's Hogswatch. That's not the time for silly arguments. All right. Oh yes, it is. Said the chair of indefinite studies glumly. It's exactly the time for silly arguments. In our family, we were lucky to get through dinner without a reprise of "What a shame Henry didn't go into business with our Ron," or "Why hasn't anyone taught those kids to use a knife?" That was another favourite. And the sulks," said Ponder Stibbins. "Oh, the sulks," said the chair of indefinite studies. Not a proper hog's watch without everyone sitting, staring at different walls. The games were worse," said Ponder. "Worse than the kids hitting one another with their toys. Do you think? Not a proper hog's watch afternoon without wheels and bits of broken dolly everywhere and everyone whining, assault and battery included. <laughs> We had a game called Hunt the Slipper." Said Ponder, "Someone hid a slipper, and then we had to find it, and then we had a row." It's not really bad," said the lecturer in recent rooms. "I mean, not proper hog's watch bad, unless everyone's wearing a paper hat. There's always that bit, isn't there, when someone's horrible great aunt puts on a paper hat and smirks at everyone because she's being so bohemian." I'd forgotten about the paper hats," said the chair of indefinite studies. Oh dear! And then later on, someone will suggest a board game," said Ponder. "That's right, where no one exactly remembers all the rules, which doesn't stop someone suggesting that you play for pennies. And five minutes later, there's two people not speaking to one another for the rest of their lives because of tuppence, and some horrible little kid. I know, I know. Some little kid who's been allowed to stay up wins everyone's money by being a nasty little cutthroat swat. Right. Ah,、uh, said Ponder, who rather suspected that he had been that child. And don't forget the presents," said the chair of indefinite studies, as if reading off some internal list of gloom. How, how full of potential they seem in all that paper. How pregnant with possibilities! And then you open them, and basically the wrapping paper was more interesting. And you have to say, "How thoughtful! That will come in handy." It's not better to give than to receive, in my opinion. It's just less embarrassing. I've worked out," said the senior wrangler, "that over the years I have been a net exporter of Hogg's watch presents." Oh, everyone is. Said the chair, "You spend a fortune on other people, and what you get when all the paper is cleared away is one slipper that's the wrong colour and a book about earwax." Red Cully sat in horrified amazement. He'd always enjoyed Hogg's Watch, every bit of it. He'd always enjoyed seeing ancient relatives. He'd enjoyed the food. He'd been good at games like Chase My Neighbour Up the Passage and Hooray Jolly Tinker. He was always the first to don a paper hat. He felt that paper hats lent a special festive air to the occasion, and he always very carefully read the messages on Hogg's watch cards and found time for a few kind thoughts about the sender. Listening to his wizards was like watching someone kick apart a doll's house. At least, the Hogg's watch cracker mottoes are fun, he ventured. They all turned to look at him, and then turned away again. If you have the sense of humour of a wire coat hanger. Said the senior wrangler. "Oh dear," said Ridcully. "Then perhaps there isn't a hog father if all you chaps are sitting around with long faces. He's not the sort to let people go around being miserable." Ridcully, he's just some old winter god," said the senior wrangler wearily. "He's not the cheerful fairy or anything." The lecturer in recent runes raised his chin from his hands. "What cheerful fairy?" Oh, it's just something my granny used to go on about if it was a wet afternoon and we were getting on her nerves," said the senior wrangler. She'd say, "I'll call the cheerful fairy if you." He stopped, looking guilty. The arch chancellor held a hand to his ear in a theatrical gesture, denoting hush. What was that I heard? Someone tinkled. He said, 
Thank you, senior wrangler. Oh, no, the senior wrangler moaned. No, no, no. They listened for a moment. We might have got away with it, said Ponder. I didn't hear anything. Yes, but you can just imagine her, can't you? said the dean. The moment you said it, I had this picture in my mind. She's going to have a whole bag of word games, for one thing, or she'll suggest we go outdoors for our health. The wizards shuddered. They weren't against the outdoors. It was simply their place in it they objected to. Cheerfulness has always got me down, said the dean. Well, if some wretched little ball of cheerfulness turns up, I shan't have it for one, said the senior wrangler, folding his arms. I've put up with monsters and trolls and big green things with teeth, so I'm not sitting still for any kind of... Hello! Hello! The voice was the kind of voice that reads suitable stories to children. Every vowel was beautifully rounded, and they could hear the extra exclamation marks born of a sort of desperate, despairing jollity slot into place. They turned. The cheerful fairy was quite short and plump in a tweed skirt, and shoes so sensible they could do their own tax returns, and was pretty much like the first teacher you got at school, the one who has special training in dealing with nervous incontinence, and little boys whose contribution to the wonderful world of sharing consists largely of hitting a small girl repeatedly over the head with a wooden horse. In fact, this picture was helped by the whistle on a string around her neck, and a general impression that at any moment she would clap her hands. The tiny gauzy wings just visible on her back were probably just for show, but the wizards kept on staring at her shoulder. Hello, she said again, but a lot more uncertainly. She gave them a suspicious look. You're rather big, boys, she said, as if they'd become so in order to spite her. She blinked. It's my job to chase those blues away, she added, apparently following a memorized script. Then she seemed to rally a bit and went on, So, chins up, everyone, and let's see a lot of bright, shining faces. Her gaze met that of the senior wrangler, who had probably never had a bright, shining face in his entire life. He specialised in dull, sullen ones. The one he was wearing now would have won prizes. Excuse me, madam, said Ridcully, but is that a chicken on your shoulder? It's, um, it's... It's the blue bird of happiness, said the cheerful fairy. Her voice now had the slightly shaking tone of someone who doesn't quite believe what she has just said, but is going to go on saying it anyway, just in case saying it will eventually make it true. I beg your pardon, but it is a, a chicken. A live chicken, said Ridcully. It just went cluck. It is blue, she said hopelessly. Well, that at least is true, Ridcully conceded, as kindly as he could manage. Left to myself, I, I, I expect I'd have imagined a slightly more streamlined blue bird of happiness, but I can't actually fault you there. The cheerful fairy coughed nervously and fiddled with the buttons on her sensible woolly jumper. How about a nice game to get us all in the mood, she said. A guessing game, perhaps, or a painting competition. There may be a small prize for the winner. Madam, we are wizards, said the senior wrangler. We don't do cheerful. Charades, said the cheerful fairy. Or perhaps you've been playing them already. <laughs> How about a sing-song? Who knows row, row, row your boat? Her bright little smile hit the group's scowl of the assembled wizards. We don't want to be Mr. Grumpy, do we? She added hopefully. Yes, said the senior wrangler. The cheerful fairy sagged and then patted frantically at her shapeless sleeves until she tugged out a balled-up handkerchief. She dabbed at her eyes. It's all going wrong again, isn't it? she said, her chin trembling. No one ever wants to be cheerful these days, and I really do try. I've made a joke book, and I've got three boxes of clothes for charades, and, and, and whenever I try to cheer people up, they all look embarrassed. And really, I do make an effort. She blew her nose loudly. Even the senior wrangler had the grace to look embarrassed. Um, he began. 
Would it hurt anyone just occasionally to try and be a little bit cheerful? said the cheerful fairy. Ah, uh, in what way? said the senior wrangler, feeling wretched. Well, there's so many nice things to be cheerful about, said the cheerful fairy, blowing her nose again. Ah,、uh, raindrops and sunsets and that sort of thing, said the senior wrangler, managing some sarcasm, but they could tell his heart wasn't in it. Uh, would you like to borrow my handkerchief? It's nearly fresh. Why don't you get the lady a nice sherry? Said Red Cully, and some corn for her chicken. Oh, I never drink alcohol, said the cheerful fairy, horrified. Really, said Red Cully. We find it something to be cheerful about. Mister Stibbins, would you be so kind as to step over here for a moment? He beckoned him up close. There's got to be a lot of belief sloshing around to let her be created," he said. "She's a good fourteen stone, if I may judge. If we wanted to contact the Hog Father, how would we go about it? Let her up chimney." "Yes, but not tonight, sir," said Ponder. "He'll be out delivering." "No telling where he'll be then," said Ridcully. "Blast!" "Of course, he might not have come here yet," said Ponder.、Uh, "Why should he come here?" Said Ridcully. The librarian pulled the blankets over himself and curled up. As an orangutan, he hankered for the warmth of the rainforest. The problem was that he'd never even seen a rainforest, having been turned into an orangutan when he was already a fully grown human. Something in his bones knew about it, though, and didn't like the cold of winter at all. But he was also a librarian in those same bones, and he flatly refused to allow fires to be lit in the library. As a result, pillows and blankets went missing everywhere else in the university, and ended up in a sort of cocoon in the reference section, in which the ape lurked during the worst of the winter. He turned over and wrapped himself in the bursar's curtains. There was a creaking outside his nest, and some whispering. No, don't light the lamp. I wondered why I hadn't seen him all evening. Oh, he goes to bed early on hogs' watches, sir. Here we are. There was some rustling. We're in luck. It hasn't been filled. Said Ponder, "Looks like he's used one of the bursars. He puts it up every year, apparently. But it's not as though he's a child. A certain childlike simplicity, perhaps. It might be different for orangutans, Arch Chancellor. Do they do it in the jungle? Do you think? I don't imagine so, sir. No chimneys, for one thing, and quite short legs, of course. Extremely underfunded in the sock area, orangutans." They'd be quids in if they could hang up gloves, of course. Hogfather would be on double shifts if they could hang up their gloves, on account of the length of their arms. Very good, Arch Chancellor. I say, what's this on the? My word, a glass of sherry. Well, waste not, want not. There was a damp, glugging noise in the darkness. I think that was supposed to be for the Hogfather, sir. And the banana? I imagine that's been left out for the pigs, sir. Pigs. Oh, you know, sir, Tusker and Snouter and Gouger and Rooter. I mean, Ponder stopped, conscious that a grown man shouldn't be able to remember this sort of thing. That's what children believe. Bananas for pigs? That's not traditional, is it? I'd have thought acorns, perhaps, or apples, or Swedes. Yes, sir, but the librarian likes bananas, sir. Very nourishing fruit, Mister Stibbins. Yes, sir. Although, funnily enough, it's not actually a fruit, sir. Really? Yes, sir. Botanically, it's a type of fish, sir. According to my theory, it's cladistically associated with the Crallian pipe fish, sir, which of course is also yellow and goes around in bunches or shoals, and lives in trees. Well, not usually, sir. The banana is obviously exploiting a new niche. Good heavens! Really? It's a funny thing, but I've never much liked bananas, and I've always been a bit suspicious of fish too. Hmm. That would explain it. Yes, sir. Do they attack swimmers? Not that I've heard, sir. Of course, they may be clever enough to only attack swimmers who are far from land. What you mean, sort of high up, in the trees, as it were? Possibly, sir. Cunning, hmm? Yes, sir. Well, we might as well make ourselves comfortable, Mister Stibbins. Yes, sir. A match flared in the darkness as Ridcully lit his pipe. The Ankh Morpork Wassailers had practiced for weeks. The custom was referred to by Anaglypta Hugs 
organizer of the best and most select group of the city's singers, as an occasion for fellowship and good cheer. One should always be wary of people who talk unashamedly of fellowship and good cheer, as if it was something that can be applied to life like a poultice. Turn your back for a moment and they may well organize a maypole dance, and frankly there's no option then but to try and make it to the tree line. The singers were halfway down Park Lane now, and halfway through the Red Rosy Hen in marvellous harmony. The Red Rosy Hen greets the dawn of the day. In fact, the hen is not the bird traditionally associated with heralding a new sunrise, but Mrs Huggs, while collecting many old folk songs for posterity, has taken care to rewrite them where necessary to avoid, as she put it, offending those of a refined disposition with unwarranted coarseness. Much to her surprise, people often couldn't spot the unwarranted coarseness until it had been pointed out to them. Sometimes a chicken is nothing but a bird. Their collecting tins were already full of donations for the poor of the city, or at least those sections of the poor who, in Mrs. Huggs's opinion, were suitably picturesque and not too smelly and could be relied upon to say thank you. People had come to their doors to listen. Orange light spilled out onto the snow. Candle lanterns glowed among the tumbling flakes. If you could have taken the lid off the scene, there would have been chocolates inside, or at least an interesting biscuit assortment. Mrs. Huggs had heard that wassailing was an ancient ritual, and you didn't need anyone to tell you what that meant, but she felt she'd carefully removed all those elements that would affront the refined ear. And it was only gradually that the singers became aware of the discord. Around the corner, slipping and sliding on the ice, came another band of singers. Some people marched to a different drummer. The drummer in question here must have been trained elsewhere, possibly by a different species on another planet. In front of the group was a legless man on a small wheeled trolley who was singing at the top of his voice and banging two saucepans together. His name was Arnold Sideways. Pushing him along was Coffin Henry, whose croaking progress through an entirely different song was punctuated by bouts of off-the-beat coughing. He was accompanied by a perfectly ordinary-looking man in torn, dirty, and yet expensive clothing, whose pleasant tenor voice was drowned out by the quacking of a duck on his head. He answered to the name of Duck Man, although he never seemed to understand why, or why he was always surrounded by people who seemed to see ducks where no ducks could be. And finally, being towed along by a small grey dog on a string, was foul old Ron, generally regarded in Aunt Morpork as the deranged beggar's deranged beggar. He was probably incapable of singing, but at least he was attempting to swear in time to the beat, or beats. The wassailers stopped and watched them in horror. Neither party noticed, as the beggars oozed and ambled up the street, that little smears of black and grey were spiralling out of the drains and squeezing out from under tiles and buzzing off into the night. People have always had the urge to sing and clang things at the dark stub of the year, when all sorts of psychic nastiness has taken advantage of the long grey days and the deep shadows to lurk and breed. Lately, people had taken to singing harmoniously, which rather lost the effect. Those who really understood just clanged something and shouted. The beggars were not, in fact, this well-versed in folkloric practice. They were just making a din in the well-founded hope that people would give them money to stop. It was just possible to make out a consensus song in there somewhere. Hog watch is coming, the pig is getting fat. Please put a dollar in the old man's hat. If you ain't got a dollar, a penny will do. And, and if you ain't got a penny... Foul old Ron yodeled solo. Then... <laughs> the duck man had with great presence of mind clamped a hand over Ron's mouth. So sorry about this, he said, but this time I'd like people not to slam their doors on us, and it doesn't scan anywhere. The nearby doors slammed regardless. The other wassailers fled hastily to a more salubrious location. Goodwill to all men was a phrase coined by someone who hadn't met foul old Ron. The beggars stopped singing, except for Arnold Sideways, who tended to live in his own small world. Nobody knows how good we can live on boots three times a day. Then the change in the air penetrated even his consciousness. Snow thumped off the trees as a contrary wind brushed them. There was a whirl of flakes, and it was just possible, since the beggars did not always have their mental compasses pointing due real, that they heard a brief snatch of conversation. It just ain't that simple, Master, that's all I'm saying. It is better to give than to receive, Albert, 
No, master, it's just a lot more expensive. You can't just go round. Things rained down on the snow. The beggars looked at them. Arnold sideways carefully picked up a sugar pig and bit its nose off. Foul old Ron peered suspiciously into a cracker that had bounced off his hat and then shook it against his ear. The duck man opened a bag of sweets. Ah, humbugs, he said. Coffin Henry unlooped a string of sausages from around his neck. Buggery, said foul old Ron. It's a cracker, said the dog, scratching its ear. You pull it. Ron waved the cracker aimlessly by one end. Oh, give it here, said the dog, and gripped the other end in its teeth. My word, said the duck man, fishing in a snowdrift. Here's a whole roast pig and a big dish of roast potatoes, miraculously uncracked. And look, look, isn't this caviar in the jar? Asparagus, potted shrimp. My goodness, what were we going to have for Hogswatch dinner, Arnold? Oh, boots! Said Arnold. He opened a fallen box of cigars and licked them. Just old boots? Oh no, stuffed with mud and with roast mud. It's good mud too. I've been saving it up. Now we can have a merry feast of goose. All right. Can we stuff it with old boots? There was a pop from the direction of the cracker. They heard foul old Ron's thinking brain dog growl. No, no, no! You put the hat on your head and you read the humorous mutter. Millennium end and shrimp," said Ron, passing the scrap of paper to the duck man. The duck man was regarded as the intellectual of the group. He peered at the motto. Ah, yes. Let's see now. It says, "Help! Help! Help! I've fallen in the cracker machine. I can't keep running on this roller. Please get me." Ah! He turned the paper over a few times. That appears to be it, except for the stains. <laughs> Always the same old mutters," said the dog. "Someone slap Ron on the back, will you? If he laughs any more, he'll. Oh, he has. Oh well, nothing new about that." The beggars spent a few more minutes picking up hams, jars, and bottles that had settled on the snow. They packed them around Arnold on his trolley, and set off down the street. How come we got all this? It's Hogswatch, right? Yeah, but who hung up their stocking? I don't think we've got any, have we? I hung up an old boot. Does that count? Do you know, Ron ate it. I'm waiting for the Hogfather, thought Ponder Stibbins. I'm in the dark, waiting for the Hogfather. Me, a believer in natural philosophy. I can find the square root of twenty-seven point four in my head. I shouldn't be doing this. He'd have to admit that the answer would be five and a bit, but at least he could come up with it. It's not as if I've hung a stocking up. There'd be some point if. He sat rigid for a moment and then pulled off his pointy sandal and rolled down a sock. It helped if you thought of it as the scientific testing of an interesting hypothesis. From out of the darkness, Rid Cully said, "How long do you think?" It's generally believed that all deliveries are completed well before midnight," said Ponder and tugged hard. "Are you all right, Mr. Stibbins?" "Fine, sir. Fine. Ah,、uh, do you happen to have a drawing pin about you, or a small nail, perhaps?" "Um, I don't believe so. It's all right. I found a penknife." After a while, Rid Cully heard a faint scratching noise in the dark. How do you spell electricity, sir? Rid Cully thought for a while. You know, I don't think I ever do. There was a silence again, and then a clang. The librarian grunted in his sleep. What are you doing? I just knocked over the coal shovel. Why are you feeling around on the mantelpiece? Oh, just you know, just just looking, a little. Experiment. After all, you never know. You never know what. Just never know. You know. Sometimes you know," said Red Cully. "I think I know quite a lot that I didn't used to know. It's amazing what you do end up knowing. I sometimes think. Hmm. I often wonder what new stuff I'll know. Well, you never know. That's a fact. High over the city, Albert turned to Death, who seemed to be trying to avoid his gaze. "You didn't get that stuff out of the sack? Not cigars and peaches in brandy and grub with fancy foreign names?" "Yes, it came out of the sack." Albert gave him a suspicious look. 
But you put it in the sack in the first place, didn't you? No. You did, didn't you? Albert stated. No. You put all those things in the sack? No. You got them from somewhere and put them in the sack? No. You did put them in the sack, didn't you? No. You put them in the sack. Yes. I knew you put them in the sack. Where did you get them? They were just lying around. Whole roast pig does not, in my experience, just lie around. No one seemed to be using them, Albert. Couple of chimneys ago we were over that big posh restaurant. Really? I don't remember. And it seemed to me you were down there a bit longer than usual, if you don't mind my saying so. Really? How exactly were they just inverted commas lying around inverted commas? Just lying around, you know, recumbent. In a kitchen? There was a certain culinariness about the place, I recall. Albert pointed a trembling finger. You nicked someone's hogswatch dinner, master. It's going to be eaten, said Death defensively. Anyway, you thought it was a good idea when I showed that king the door. Yeah, well, that was a bit different, said Albert, lowering his voice. But I mean, the hogfather doesn't drop down the chimney and pinch people's grub. The beggars will enjoy it, Albert. Well, yes, but it wasn't stealing; it was just redistribution. It will be a good deed in a naughty world. No, it won't. Then it will be a naughty deed in a naughty world, and will pass completely unnoticed. Yeah, but you might at least have thought about the people whose grub you pinched. They have been provided for, of course. I am not completely heartless, in a metaphorical sense. And now, onwards and upwards. We're heading down, master. Onwards and downwards, then. There were swirls. Binky galloped easily through them, except that he did not seem to move. He might have been hanging in the air. Oh me," said the O God weakly. "What?" said Susan. "Try shutting your eyes." Susan shut her eyes. Then she reached up to touch her face. "I'm still seeing. I thought it was just me. It's usually just me." The swirls vanished. There was greenery below. And that was odd. It was greenery. Susan had flown a few times over countryside, even swamps and jungles, and there had never been a green as green as this. If green could be a primary colour, this was it. And that wiggly thing—that's not a river, she said, isn't it? It's blue. The ogre risked a look down. Water's blue, he said. Of course it's not. Grass is green, water's blue. I can remember that. It's some of the stuff I just know. Well, in a way, Susan hesitated. Everyone knew grass was green and water was blue. Quite often, it wasn't true, but everyone knew it in the same way that they knew the sky was blue too. She made the mistake of looking up as she thought that. There was the sky. It was indeed blue, and down there was the land. It was green, and in between, nothing. Not white space, not black night, just nothing. All round the edges of the world, where the brain said there should be well, sky and land meeting neatly at the horizon, there was simply a void that sucked at the eyeballs like a loose tooth. And there was the sun; it was under the sky, floating above the land, and it was yellow, buttercup yellow. Binky landed on the grass beside the river, or at least on the green. It felt more like sponge or moss. He nuzzled it. Susan slid off, trying to keep her gaze low. That meant she was looking at the vivid blue of the water. There were orange fish in it. They didn't look quite right, as if they'd been created by someone who really did think a fish was two curved lines and a dot and a triangular tail. They reminded her of the skeletal fish in Death's Quiet Pool, fish that were appropriate to their surroundings, and she could see them, even though the water was just a block of colour, which part of her insisted ought to be opaque. She knelt down and dipped her hand in. It felt like water, but what poured through her fingers was liquid blue. And now she knew where she was.
The last piece clicked into place and the knowledge bloomed inside her. She knew if she saw a house just how its windows would be placed and just how the smoke would come out of the chimney. There would almost certainly be apples on the trees and they would be red because everyone knew that apples were red and the sun was yellow and the sky was blue and the grass was green. But there was another world called the real world by the people who believed in it where the sky could be anything from off-white to sunset red to thunderstorm yellow. And the trees would be anything from bare branches, mere scribbles against the sky, to red flames before the frost, and the sun was white or yellow or orange, and water was brown and grey and green. The colours here were springtime colours, and not the springtime of the world. They were the colours of the springtime of the eye. This is a child's painting, she said. The O-God slumped onto the green. Every time I look at the gap, my eyes water, he mumbled. I feel awful. I said, this is a child's painting, said Susan. Oh, me. I think the wizard's potion is wearing off. I've seen dozens of pictures of it, said Susan, ignoring him. You put the sky overhead because the sky's above you, and when you're a couple of feet high, there's not a lot of sideways to the sky in any case. And everyone tells you grass is green and water is blue. This is the landscape you paint. Twyla paints like that. I painted like that. Grandfather saved some of... She stopped. All children do it anyway, she muttered. Come on, let's find the house. What house? The O God moaned. And can you speak quieter, please? There'll be a house, said Susan, standing up. There's always a house with four windows and the smoke coming out of the chimney all curly like a spring. Look, this is a place like Grand... like Death's country. It's not really geography. The O-God walked over to the nearest tree and banged his head on it as if he hoped it was going to hurt. Feels like geography, he muttered. But have you ever seen a tree like that, a big green blob on a brown stick? It looks like a lollipop, said Susan, pulling him along. Dunno. First time I ever saw a tree... Oh, something dropped on my head. He blinked owlishly at the ground. It's red. It's an apple, she said. She sighed. Everyone knows apples are red. There were no bushes, but there were flowers, each with a couple of green leaves. They grew individually, dotted around the rolling green. And then they were out of the trees, and there, by a bend in the river, was the house. It didn't look very big. There were four windows and a door. Corkscrew smoke curled out of the chimney. You know, it's a funny thing, said Susan, staring at it. Twyla draws houses like that, and she practically lives in a mansion. I drew houses like that, and I was born in a palace. Why? Perhaps it's all this house, muttered the O-God miserably. What, you really think so? Kids' paintings are all of this place. It's in our heads. Don't ask me. I was just making conversation, said the O-God. Susan hesitated. The words, what now, loomed. Should she just go and knock? And she realised that was normal thinking. In the glittering, clattering, chattering atmosphere, a head waiter was having a difficult time. There were a lot of people in, and the staff should have been fully stretched, putting bicarbonate of soda in the white wine to make very expensive bubbles, and cutting the vegetables very small to make them cost more. Instead, they were standing in a dejected group in the kitchen. <laughs> Where did it all go? screamed the manager. Someone's been through the cellar, too. William said he felt a cold wind, said the waiter. He'd been backed up against a hot plate, and now knew why it was called a hot plate, in a way he hadn't fully comprehended before. <sighs> I'll give him a cold wind. Haven't we got anything? There's odds and ends. You don't mean odds and ends. You mean des curieux et des bouts, corrected the manager. Yeah, right, and, uh, and, uh, there's nothing else? Uh, old boots, muddy old boots. Old boots, lots of them, said the waiter. He felt he was beginning to singe. How come we've got vintage footwear? Dunno, they just turned up, sir. The oven's full of old boots, so's the pantry. There's a hundred people booked in. All the shops will be shut. Where's chef? William's trying to get him to come out of the privy, sir. He's locked himself in and is having one of his moments. 
Something's cooking. What's that I can smell? Me, sir. Old boots, muttered the manager. Old boots, old boots. Leather, are they? Not clogs or, or rubber or anything? Looks like just boots and lots of mud, sir. The manager took off his jacket. All right. Got any cream, have we? Onions, garlic, butter, some old beef bones, bit of pastry. Uh, yes. The manager rubbed his hands together. Right, he said, taking an apron off a hook. You there, get some water boiling, lots of water, and find a really large hammer. And you, chop some onions. Rest of you, start sorting out the boots. I want the tongues out and the soles off. We'll do them. Let's see. Uh, mousse. De la boue dans un panier de la pâte de chaussure. Where are we going to get that from, sir? Mud mousse in a basket of shoe pastry. Get the idea? It's not our fault if even Quermians don't understand restaurant Quermium. It's not like lying, after all. Well, it's a bit like lying. The waiter began. He'd been cursed with honesty at an early stage. Then there's brodequin roti façon ombre. The manager sighed at the head waiter's panicky expression. Soldier's boot done in the shades fashion. He translated. Yeah, shades fashion, in mud. But if we cook the tongue separately, we can put on languette brise too. There's some ladies' shoes, sir," said an underchef. Right. Add to the menu. Let's see now. Let's see.、Uh, Sole d'une bonne femme, and yes,、uh, servi dans un coulis de terre en l'eau. That's mud to you. What about the laces, sir? Said another underchef. Good thinking. Dig out that recipe for spaghetti carbonara. Sir, said the head waiter. I started off as a chef. Said the manager, picking up a knife. How do you think I was able to afford this place? I know how it's done. Get the look and the sauce right, and you're three quarters there. But it's all going to be old boots, sir," said the waiter. "Prime aged beef," the manager corrected him.、Ah, "It'll tenderize in no time. Anyway, anyway, we haven't got any soup, mud, and a lot of onions. There's the puddings, mud. Let's see if we can get it to caramelize. You never know. I can't even find the coffee. Still, they probably won't last till the coffee, mud. Café de Terre," said the manager firmly. "Genuine ground coffee." Oh, they'll spot that, sir. They haven't up till now," said the manager darkly. "We'll never get away with it, sir. Never." In the country of the sky on top, medium Dave Lillywhite hauled another bag of money down the stairs. <laughs> "There must be thousands here," said Chicken Wire. "Hundreds of thousands," said medium Dave. "And what's all this stuff?" said Cat's Eye, opening a box. "It's just paper." He tossed it aside. Medium Dave sighed. He was all for class solidarity, but sometimes Cat's Eye got on his nerves. They're the title deeds, he said, and they're better than money. Papers better than money, said Cat's Eye. Huh? If you can burn it, you can't spend it. That's what I say. Hang on, said Chicken Wire. <laughs> I know about them. The Tooth Fairy owns property. Got to raise money somehow, said Medium Dave. All those half dollars under the pillow. If we steal them, do they become ours? Is that a trick question? Said Cat's Eye, smirking. Yeah, but ten thousand each doesn't sound such a lot when you see all this. He won't miss a gentleman. They turned. Tea time was in the doorway. We were just <laughs> we were just piling up the stuff. Said Chicken Wire. Yes, I know. I told you to. Right, that's right. You did. Said Chicken Wire gratefully. And there's such a lot," said Tea Time. He gave them a smile. Cat's Eye coughed. "It's got to be thousands," said Medium Dave. "And what about all these deeds and so on? Look, this one's for that pipe shop on Honey Trap Lane, in Ark Moorpark. I buy my tobacco there. Old Thimble is always moaning about the rent too." "Ah, so you opened the strong boxes," said Tea Time pleasantly. "Well, yes, fine." Fine," said Tea Time. "I didn't ask you to, but fine, fine. And how did you think the Tooth Fairy made her money? Little gnomes in some mine somewhere, fairy gold. But that turns to trash in the morning." He laughed. Chicken Wire laughed. Even Medium Dave laughed. 
and then tea time was on him, pushing him irresistibly backwards until he hit the wall. There was a blur, and he tried to blink, and his left eyelid was suddenly a rose of pain. Tea time's good eye was close to him, if you could call it good. The pupil was a dot. Medium Dave could just make out his hand right by Medium Dave's face. It was holding a knife. The point of the blade could only be the merest fraction of an inch from Medium Dave's right eye. I know people say I'd kill them as soon as look at them, whispered Tea Time, and in fact I'd much rather kill you than look at you, Mr. Lillywhite. You stand in a castle of gold and plot to steal pennies, oh dear. What am I to do with you? He relaxed a little, but his hand still held the knife to Medium Dave's unblinking eye. You're thinking that Banjo is going to help you, he said. That's how it's always been, isn't it? That Banjo likes me. He really does. Banjo is my friend. Medium Dave managed to focus beyond Tea Time's ear. His brother was just standing there with the blank face he had while he waited for another order or a new thought to turn up. If I thought you were feeling bad thoughts about me, I would be so downcast, said Tea Time. I do not have many friends left, Mr. Medium Dave. He stood back and smiled happily. All friends now, he said, as Medium Dave slumped down. Help him, Banjo. On cue, Banjo lumbered up. Banjo has the heart of a little child, said Tea Time, the knife disappearing somewhere about his clothing. I believe I have too. The others were frozen in place. They hadn't moved since the attack. Medium Dave was a heavy set man, and Tea Time was a matchstick model, but he'd lifted Medium Dave off his feet like a feather. As far as the money goes, in fact, I really have no use for it, said Tea Time, sitting down on a sack of silver. It is small change. You may share it out amongst yourselves, and no doubt you'll squabble and double cross one another more tiresomely. Oh, dear, it is so awful when friends fall out. He kicked the sack. It split. Silver and copper fell in an expensive trickle. And you'll swagger and spend it on drink and women, he said as they watched the coins roll into every corner of the room. The thought of investment will never cross your scarred little minds. There was a rumble from Banjo. Even tea time waited patiently until the huge man had assembled a sentence. The result was, I got a piggy bank. And what would you do with a million dollars, Banjo? said tea time. Another rumble. Banjo's face twisted up. Buy a, a bigger piggy bank? Well done. The assassin stood up. Let's go and see how our wizard is getting on, shall we? He walked out of the room without looking back. After a moment, Banjo followed. The others tried not to look at one another's faces. Then Chicken Wire said, uh, Was he saying we could <laughs> take the money and, and go? Don't be bloody stupid. We wouldn't get ten yards, said Medium Dave, still clutching his face. Oh, this hurts. I think he cut the eyelid. He cut the damn eyelid. Then let's just <laughs> leave the stuff and go. I never joined up to ride on tigers. And what'll you do when he comes after you? Why'd he bother with the likes of us? He's got time for his friends, said Medium Dave bitterly. For God's sakes, someone get me a clean rag or something. OK, but... <laughs> He can't look everywhere. Medium Dave shook his head. He'd been through Ark Morpork's very own University of the Streets, and had graduated with his life, and an intelligence made all the keener by constant friction. You only had to look into Tea Time's mismatched eyes to know one thing, which was this, that if Tea Time wanted to find you, he would not look everywhere. He'd look in only one place, which would be the place where you were hiding. How come your brother likes him so much? Medium Dave grimaced. Banjo had always done what he was told, simply because Medium Dave had told him to. Up to now, anyway. It must have been that punch in the bar. Medium Dave didn't like to think about it. He'd always promised their mother that he'd look after Banjo, and Banjo had gone back like a falling tree. It had been Ma Lillywhite's dying wish, although she hadn't known it at the time. Her last words to her son were, "'You try and get the horses. I'll try to hold them off on the stairs.' And if anything happens to me, take care of the dummy. And when Medium Dave had risen from his seat to punch Tea Time's unbalanced lights out, he'd suddenly found the assassin already behind him, holding a knife, in front of everyone. It was humiliating, that's what it was. And then Banjo had sat up, looking puzzled, and spat out a tooth. 
If it wasn't for Banjo going around with him all the time, we could gang up on him, said Cat's Eye. Medium Dave looked up, one hand clamping handkerchief to his eye. Gang up on him, he said. Yeah, it's all your fault, Chicken Wire went on. Oh, yeah, so it wasn't you who said, wow, ten thousand dollars count me in. Chicken Wire backed away. I didn't know there was going to be all this, this creepy stuff. I want to go home. Medium Dave hesitated, despite his pain and rage. This wasn't normal talk for Chicken Wire, for all that he whined and grumbled. This was a strange place, no lie about that. And all that business with the teeth had been very odd. But he'd been out with Chicken Wire when jobs had gone wrong, and both the Watch and the Thieves' Guild had been after them, and he'd been as cool as anyone. And if the Guild had been the ones to catch them, they'd have nailed their ears to their ankles and thrown them in the river. In Medium Dave's book, which was a simple book and largely written in mental crayon, Things didn't get creepier than that. "'What's up with you?' he said. "'All of you. You're acting like little kids.' "'Would he deliver to apes earlier than humans?' "'Interesting point, sir. Possibly you're referring to my theory that humans may have in fact descended from apes, of course,' said Ponder. "'A bold hypothesis which ought to sweep away the ignorance of centuries "'if the Grants Committee could just see their way clear to letting me hire a boat "'and sail around to the islands of—' "'I just thought he might deliver alphabetically,' said Ridcully. "'There was a patter of soot in the cold fireplace. "'That's presumably him now, do you think?' Ridcully went on. "'Oh, well, I thought we should check.' "'Something landed in the ashes.' The two wizards stood quietly in the darkness while the figure picked itself up. There was a rustle of paper. Let me see now. There was a click as Rid Cully's pipe fell out of his mouth. Who the hell are you? he said. Mr. Stibbons, light a candle. Death backed away. I'm the hog father, of course. Um, ho, ho, ho. Who would you expect to come down a chimney on a night like this, may I ask? No, you're not. I am. Look, I've got the beard and the pillow and everything. You look extremely thin in the face. I'm... I... I'm not well. It's all... Uh, yes, it's all this sherry and rushing around. I am a bit ill. Terminally, I should say. Ridcully grabbed the beard. There was a twang as the string gave way. It's a false beard. No, it's not said Death desperately. Here's the hooks for the ears, which must have given you a bit of trouble, I must say. Ridcully flourished the incriminating evidence. What were you doing coming down the chimney? he continued. Not in marvellous taste, I think. Death waved a small grubby scrap of paper defensively. Official letter to the Hogfather, says here, he began, and then looked at the paper again. Well, quite a lot, in fact. It's a long list. Library stamps, reference books, pencils, bananas. The librarian asked the Hogfather for those things, said Ridcully. Why? I don't know, said Death. This was a diplomatic answer. He kept his finger over a reference to the Arch-Chancellor. The orangutan for Duck's Bottom was quite an interesting squiggle. I've got plenty in my desk drawer, mused Ridcully. I'm quite happy to give them out to any chap, provided he can prove he's used up the old one. They must show you an absence of pencil? Of course. If he needed uh, essential materials, he need only have come to me. No man can tell you I'm an unreasonable chap. Death checked the list carefully. That is precisely correct, he confirmed, with anthropological exactitude. Except for the bananas, of course, I, I wouldn't keep fish in my desk. Death looked down the list and then back up at Ridcully. Good, he said, in the hope that this was the right response. Wizards know when they are going to die. They generally know in time to have their best robe cleaned, do some serious damage to the wine cellar, and have a really good last meal. It's a nicer version of Death Row, with the bonus of no lawyers. Ridcully had no such premonitions, and to Ponder's horror, prodded Death in the cushion. Why you, he said, what's happened to the other fellow? I suppose I must tell you. In the house of death, a whisper of shifting sand and the faintest chink of moving glass, somewhere in the darkness of the floor. 
and in the dry shadows the sharp smell of snow and a thud of hooves. Sidney almost swallowed his tongue when tea-time appeared beside him. Are we making progress? <coughs> I'm sorry, said tea-time. Sidney recovered himself. Um, uh, some, he said. We think we've worked out, uh, one lock. Light gleamed off tea-time's eye. I believe there are seven of them, said the assassin. Yes, but they're half magic and, and, and half real and half not there. I mean, there's parts of them that don't exist all the time. Mr. Brown, who had been working at one of the locks, laid down his pick. It's no good, mister, he said. Can't even get a purchase with a crowbar. Maybe if I went back to the city and got a couple of dragons we could do something. You can melt through steel with them if you twist their necks right and feed them carbon. I was told you were the best locksmith in the city, said Tea Time. Behind him, Banjo shifted position. Mr. Brown looked annoyed. Well, yes, he said, but locks don't generally alter themselves while you're working on them. That's what I'm saying. And I thought you could open any lock anyone ever made, said Tea Time. Made by humans, said Mr. Brown sharply, and most dwarfs. I don't know what made these. You never said anything about magic. That's a shame, said Tea Time. Then really I have no more need of your services. You may as well go back home. I won't be sorry, Mr. Brown started putting things back into his tool bag. What about my money? Do I owe you any? I came along with you. I didn't see it's my fault that this is all magic business. I should get something. Ah, oh, yes, I see your point, said Tea Time. Of course you should get what you deserve. Banjo? Banjo lumbered forward and then stopped. Mr. Brown's hand had come out of the bag holding a crowbar. You must think I was born yesterday, you slimy little bugger, he said. I know your type. You think it's all some kind of game. You make little jokes to yourself and you think no one else notices and you think you're so smart. Well, Mr. Teacup, I'm leaving right, right now, with what's coming to me, and you ain't stopping me, and Banjo certainly ain't. I knew old Ma Lillywhite back in the good old days. You think you're nasty? You think you're mean? <laughs> Ma Lillywhite would tear your eyes off and spit them in your eye, you cocky little devil. And I worked with her, so you don't scare me, and nor does little Banjo, poor stud that he is. Mr. Brown glared at each of them in turn, flourishing the crowbar. Sidney cowered in front of the doors. He saw Tea Time nod gracefully, as if the man had made a small speech of thanks. I appreciate your point of view, said Tea Time, and I have to repeat, it's Tea Tim E. Now, please, Banjo. Banjo loomed over Mr. Brown, reached down, and lifted him up by the crowbar so sharply that his feet came out of his boots. Here, yeah, you know me, Banjo, the locksmith croaked, struggling in midair. I remembers you when you was little. I used to sit you on my knees. I often used to work for your ma. Do you like apples? Banjo rumbled. Brown struggled. You got to say yes, Banjo said. Yes. Do you like pears? You got to say yes. All right, yes. Do you like falling down the stairs? Medium Dave held up his hands for quiet. He glared at the gang. This place is getting to you right, but we've all been in bad places before, right? Not this bad, said Chicken Wire. I've never been anywhere where it hurts to look at the sky. Oh, gives me the creeps. Chick's a little baby, near, 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 sang Cat's Eye. They looked at him. He coughed nervously. Sorry, don't know why I said that. If we stick together, we'll be fine. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, mumbled Cat's Eye. What? What are you talking about? Sorry. It just sort of slipped out. What I'm trying to say, said Medium Dave, is that if... Peachy keeps making faces at me. I didn't. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Two things happened at this point. Medium Dave lost his temper and Peachy screamed. A small wisp of smoke was rising from his trousers. He hopped around, beating desperately at himself. Who did that? Who did that? demanded Medium Dave. I didn't see anyone, said Chicken Wire. I mean, no one was near him. 
Cat's eyes had their pants on fire, and, and next minute... Now he's sucking his thumb, Cat's eye jeered. Nyeh, 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 crying for mummy. You know what happens to kids who suck their thumbs? There's this big monster with scissors all... Will you stop talking like that? shouted Medium Dave. Blame it, it's like dealing with a bunch of... Someone screamed high above. It went on for a while and seemed to be getting nearer, but then it stopped and it was replaced by a rush of thumping and an occasional sound like a coconut being bounced on a stone floor. Medium Dave got to the door just in time to see the body of Mr. Brown, the locksmith, tumble past, moving quite fast and not at all neatly. A moment later his bag somersaulted around the curve of the stairs. It split as it bounced and there was a jangle as tools and lock picks bounced out and followed their late owner. He'd been moving quite fast. He'd probably roll all the way to the bottom. Medium Dave looked up. Two turns above him on the opposite side of the huge shaft, Banjo was watching him. Banjo didn't know right from wrong. He'd always left that sort of thing to his brother. Er, uh, poor guy must have slipped, Medium Dave mumbled. Oh, yeah, slipped, said Peachy. He looked up too. It was funny. He hadn't noticed them before. The white tower had seemed to glow from within, but now there were shadows moving across the stone, in the stone. "'What was that?' he said. "'That sound. What sound?' "'It sounded like knives scraping,' said Peachy. "'Really close.' "'There's only us here,' said Medium Dave. "'What are you afraid of, attack by daisies? Come on, let's go and help him.' She couldn't walk through the door. It simply resisted any such effort. She ended up merely bruised, so Susan turned the doorknob instead. She heard the Oh God gasp, but she was used to the idea of buildings that were bigger on the inside. Her grandfather had never been able to get a handle on dimensions. The second thing the eye was drawn to were the staircases. They started opposite one another in what was now a big round tower, its ceiling lost in the haze. The spirals circled into infinity. Susan's eyes went back to the first thing. It was a large... Conical heap in the middle of the floor. It was white. It glistened in the cool light that shone down from the mists. It's teeth, she said. I think I'm going to throw up, said the O-God miserably. There's nothing scary about teeth, said Susan. She didn't mean it. The heap was very horrible indeed. Did I say I was scared? I'm just hung over again. Oh, oh me... Susan advanced on the heap, moving warily. They were small teeth, children's teeth. Whoever had piled them up hadn't been very careful about it either. A few had been scattered across the floor. She knew because she trod on one, and the slippery little crunching sound made her desperate not to tread on any more. Whoever had piled them up had presumably been the one who'd drawn the chalk marks around the obscene heap. There's so many, whispered Bilius. At least twenty million, given the size of the average milk tooth, said Susan. She was shocked to find that it came almost automatically. How can you possibly know that? Volume of a cone, said Susan. Pi times the square of the radius times the height, divided by three. I bet Miss Butts never thought it would come in handy in a place like this. That's amazing. You did it in your head? This isn't right said Susan quietly. I don't think this is what the tooth fairy is all about. All that effort to get the teeth and then just to dump them like this. Uh, anyway, there's a cigarette end on the floor. I don't see the tooth fairy as someone who rolls her own. She stared down at the chalk marks. Voices high above her made her look up. She thought she saw a head look over the stair rail and then draw back again. She didn't see much of the face, but what she saw didn't look fairy-like. She glanced back at the circle of chalk around the teeth. Someone had wanted all the teeth in one place, and had drawn a circle to show people where they had to go. There were a few symbols scrawled around the circle. She had a good memory for small details. It was another family trait. And a small detail stirred in her memory like a sleepy bee. Oh, no, she breathed. Surely no one would try to. Someone shouted, someone up in the whiteness. A body rolled down the stairs nearest her. It had been a skinny, middle-aged man. Technically, it still was, but the long spiral staircase had not been kind. It tumbled across the white marble and slid to a boneless halt. 
Then, as she hurried towards the body, it faded away, leaving nothing behind but a smear of blood. A jingle noise made her look back up the stairs, spinning over and over, making salmon leaps in the air, a crowbar bounded over the last dozen steps and landed point-first on a flagstone, staying upright and vibrating. Chicken Wire reached the top of the stairs, panting. "'There's people down there, Mr. Tea-Time,' he wheezed. "'Dave and the others have gone down to catch them, Mr. Tea-Time.' te a tim -e, said Tea-Time, without taking his eyes off the wizard. "'That's right, sir.' "'Well,' said Tea-Time, "'just do away with them.' Uh, uh, one of them's a girl, sir. Tea time still didn't look round. He waved a hand vaguely. Then do away with them politely. Uh, yes, mister. Yes, right. <coughs> Chicken wire coughed. Do you want to find out why they're here, sir? Good heavens, no. Why should I want to do that? Now go away. Chicken wire stood there for a moment and then hurried off. As he scurried down the stairs, he thought he heard a creak as of an ancient wooden door. He went pale. It was just a door, said the sensible bit in front of his brain. There were hundreds of them in this place, although, come to think of it, none of them had creaked. The other bit, the bit that hung around in dark places nearly at the top of his spinal column, said, But it's not one of them, and you know it, because you know which door it really is. He hadn't heard that creak for thirty years. He gave a little yelp, and started to take the stairs four at a time. In the hollows and corners the shadows grew darker. Susan ran up a flight of stairs, dragging the Ogod behind her. Do you know what they've been doing, she said. You know why they've got all those teeth in a circle? The power. Oh, my. I'm not going to, said the head waiter firmly. Look, I'll buy you a better pair after Hogswatch. There's two more choux pastry, one for puree de la terre, and three more tourte à la boue, said a waiter hurrying in. Mud pies, moaned the waiter. I can't believe we're selling mud pies, and now you want my boots. With cream and sugar, mind you. <laughs> a real taste of ankh pork, And we can get at least four helpings off those boots. Fair's fair. We're all in our socks. Table seven says the steaks were lovely but a bit tough, said a waiter rushing past. Right. Use a larger hammer next time and boil them for longer. The manager turned back to the suffering head waiter. Look, Bill, he said, taking him by the shoulder, this isn't food. No one expects it to be food. If people wanted food, they'd stay at home. Isn't that so? They come here for ambience, for the experience. This isn't cookery, Bill. This is, this is cuisine, see? And they're coming back for more. Yeah, but old boots... Dwarfs eat rats, said the manager, and trolls eat rocks. There's folks in Hawanderland that eat insects, and folks on the counterweight continent eat soup made out of bird spit. At least the boots have been on a cow. And mud, said the head waiter gloomily. Isn't there an old proverb that says a man must eat a bushel of dirt before he dies? Yes, but not all at once. Bill, said the manager, kindly, picking up a spatula. Yes, boss? Get those damn boots off right now, will you? When Chicken Wire reached the bottom of the tower, he was trembling, and not just from the effort. He headed straight for the door until Medium Dave grabbed him. Let me out! Uh, it's after me! Look at his face, said Cat's Eye. Looks like he's seen a ghost. Yeah, well, it ain't a ghost, muttered Chicken Wire. It's worse than a ghost. Medium Dave slapped him across the face. Pull yourself together. Look around, nothing's cheating you. Anyway, it's not as though we couldn't put up a fight, right? Terror had had time to drain away a little. Chicken Wire looked back up the stairs. There was nothing there. Good, said Medium Dave, watching his face. Now, what happened? Chicken Wire looked at his feet. I thought it was the wardrobe, he muttered. Go on, laugh. They didn't laugh. What wardrobe? said Cat's Eye. Oh, when I was a kid. Chicken Wire waved his arms vaguely. We had this big old wardrobe, if you must know. Oak. It had this, <laughs> this, on the door there was this sort of face. He looked at their faces, which were equally wooden. I mean, not an actual face. There was a, all this decoration around the keyhole, sort of flowers and leaves and stuff. But if you looked at it in the right way, it was a face. And they put it in my room because it was so big and in the night. In the night. 
in the night. They were grown men, or at least had lived for several decades, which in some societies is considered the same thing. But you had to stare at a man so creased up with dread. Yes, said Cat's Eye hoarsely. It whispered things, said Chicken Wire in a quiet little voice, like a vole in a dungeon. They looked at one another. What things? Said Medium Dave. I don't know. I always had my head under the pillow. Anyway, it's just something from when I was a kid. All right. Our dad got rid of it in the finish, burned it, and I watched. They mentally shook themselves as people do when their minds emerge back into the light. It's like me in the dark, said Cat's Eye. Oh, don't you start, said Medium Dave. Anyway, you ain't afraid of the dark. You're famed for it. I've been working with you in all kinds of cellars and stuff. I mean, that's how you got your name, Cat's Eye. Sees like a cat. Yeah, well, you try and make up for it, don't you? Said Cat's Eye. 'Cause when you're grown, you know it's just shadows and stuff. Besides, it ain't like the dark we used to have in the cellar. Oh, they had a special kind of dark when you was a lad, did they? Said Medium Dave. Not like the kind of dark you get these days, hm? Sarcasm didn't work. No. Said Cat's Eye simply. It wasn't. In our cellar, it wasn't. Our mam used to wallop us if we went down to the cellar. Said Medium Dave. She had a still down there. Yeah. Said Cat's Eye from somewhere far off. Well, our dad used to wallop us if we tried to get out. Now shut up talking about it. They reached the bottom of the stairs. There was an absence of anybody, and any body. He couldn't have survived that, could he? Said Medium Dave. I saw him as he went past," said Cat's Eye. "Necks aren't supposed to bend that way." He squinted upwards. "Who's that moving up there?" "How are their necks moving?" quavered Chicken Wire. "Split up," said Medium Dave. "And this time, all take a stairway. Then they can't come back down." "Who are they? Why are they here?" "Why are we here?" said Peachy. He started and looked behind him. Taking our money after us putting up with him. Yeah," said Peachy, distantly trailing after the others. "Uh, did you hear that noise just then? What noise? Sort of clipping, snipping. No, no, no. You must have imagined it." Peachy nodded miserably, as he walked up the stairs. Little shadows raced through the stone and followed his feet. Susan darted off the stairs and dragged the ogre along a corridor lined with white doors. I think they saw us," she said. "And if they're tooth fairies, there's been a really stupid equal opportunities policy." She pushed open a door. There were no windows to the room, but it was lit perfectly well by the walls themselves. Down the middle of the room was something like a display case, its lid gaping open. Bits of card littered the floor. She reached down and picked one up and read, "Thomas Ague, aged four and nearly three quarters, nine Castle View, Stow Lat." The writing was in a meticulous rounded script. She crossed the passage to another room, where there was the same scene of devastation. So now we know where the teeth were," she said. "They must have taken them out of everywhere and carried them downstairs." "What for?" she sighed. "It's such old magic. It isn't even magic any more," she said. "If you've got a piece of someone's hair, or a nail clipping, or a tooth, you can control them." The O God tried to focus. That heap's controlling millions of children. Yes, adults too by now, and you—you you could make them think things and do things. She nodded. Yes, you could get them to open Dad's wallet and post the contents to some address. Well, I—I I hadn't thought of that, but yes, I suppose you could. Or go downstairs and smash all the bottles in the drinks cabinet and promise never to take a drink when they grow up," said the Ogod hopefully. What are you talking about? It's all right for you. You don't wake up every morning and see your whole life flush before your eyes. Medium Dave and Cat's Eye ran down the passage and stopped where it forked. "You go that way. I'll." "Why don't we stick together?" said Cat's Eye. "What's got into everyone? I saw you bite the throats out of a couple of guard dogs when we did that job in Quirm. Want me to hold your hand? You check the doors down there. I'll check them along here." He walked off. Cat's Eye peered down the other passage. There weren't many doors down there. It wasn't very long, and as tea time had said, there was nothing dangerous here that they hadn't brought with them. He heard voices coming from a doorway and sagged with relief. He could deal with humans. 
As he approached, a sound made him look round. Shadows were racing down the passage behind him. They cascaded down the walls and flowed over the ceiling. Where shadows met, they became darker, and darker, and rose and leapt. What was that? said Susan. Sounded like the start of a scream, said Billius. Susan threw open the door. There was no one outside. There was movement, though. She saw a patch of darkness in the corner of a wall shrink and fade, and another shadow slid around the bend of the corridor. And there was a pair of boots in the centre of the corridor. She hadn't remembered any boots there before. She sniffed. The air tasted of rats and damp and mould. Let's get out of here, she said. How are we going to find Violet in all these rooms? I don't know. I should be able to sense her, but I can't. Susan peered around the end of the corridor. She could hear men shouting some way off. They slipped out onto the stairs again and managed another flight. There were more rooms here, and in each one a cabinet that had been broken open. Shadows moved in the corners. The effect was as though some invisible light source was gently shifting. This reminds me a lot of your um, of your grandfather's place," said the Ogod. "I know," said Susan. "There aren't any rules except the ones he makes up as he goes along. I can't see him being very happy if someone got in and started pulling the library apart." She stopped. When she spoke again, her voice had a different tone. "This is a children's place," she said. "The rules are what children believe." Well, that's a relief. You think so? Things aren't going to be right. In the soul cake ducks country, ducks can lay chocolate eggs in the same way that Death's country is black and sombre because that's what people believe. He's very conventional about that sort of thing. Skull and bone decorations all over the place, and this place, pretty flowers and an odd sky. I think it's going to be a lot worse than that, and very odd too. More odd than it is now. I don't think it's possible to die here. That man who fell down the stairs looked pretty dead to me. Oh, you die, but not here. You let's see. Yes, you go somewhere else, away. You're just not seen any more. That's about all you understand when you're three. Grandfather said it wasn't like that fifty years ago. He said you often couldn't see the bed for everyone having a good cry. Now they just tell the child that grandma's gone. For three weeks, Twyla thought her uncle had been buried in the sad patch behind the garden shed, along with Buster and Meepo and all three bulges. Three bulges, gerbils. They tend to die a lot," said Susan. "The trick is to replace them when she's not looking. You really don't know anything, do you?" "Uh, hello." The voice came from the corridor. They worked their way round to the next room. There, sitting on the floor and tied to the leg of a white display case, was Violet. She looked up in apprehension, and then in bewilderment, and finally, in growing recognition. Aren't you? Yes, yes. We see each other sometimes in beers. And when you came for Twyla's last tooth, you were so shocked that I could see you. I had to give you a drink to get your nerves back," said Susan, fumbling with the ropes. "I don't think we've got a lot of time." And who's he? The ogod tried to push his lank hair into place. Oh, he's just a god," said Susan. "His name's Billius. Do you、um, drink at all?" said the ogod. "What sort of question?" He needs to know before he decides whether he hates you or not," said Susan. "It's a god thing." "No, I don't," said Violet. "What an idea! I've got the blue ribbon." The ogod raised his eyebrows at Susan. That means she's a member of Offler's League of Temperance," said Susan. "They sign a pledge not to touch alcohol. I can't think why. Of course, Offler's a crocodile. They don't go in bars much. They're into water. Never touch alcohol at all," said the Ogod. "Never," said Violet. "My dad's very strict about that sort of thing." After a moment, Susan felt forced to wave a hand across their locked gaze. "Can we get on?" she said. "Good. Who brought you here, Violet?" I don't know. I was doing the collection as usual, and then I thought I heard someone following me, and then it all went dark. And when I came to, we were. Have you seen what it's like outside? Yes. Well, we were there. The big one was carrying me. The one they call Banjo. He's not bad, just a bit odd, sort of slow. He just watches me. The others are thugs. Watch out for the one with the glass eye. They're all afraid of him, except Banjo. 
glass eye. He's dressed like an assassin. He's called Tea Time. I think they're trying to steal something. They spent ages carting the teeth out. Little teeth everywhere. It was horrible. Thank you, she added to the ogod who had helped her onto her feet. They've piled them up in a magic circle downstairs, said Susan. Violet's eyes and mouth formed three O's. It was like looking at a pink bowling ball. What for? I think they're using them to control the children by magic. Violet's mouth opened wider. That's horrid. Horrible, thought Susan. The word is horrible. Horrid is a childish word selected to impress nearby males with one's fragility, if I may judge. She knew it was unkind and counterproductive of her to think like that. She also knew it was probably an accurate observation, which only made it worse. Yes, she said. There was a wizard. He's got a pointy hat. I think we should get her out of here," said the ogod in a tone of voice that Susan considered was altogether too dramatic. "Good idea," she conceded. "Let's go." Cat's eyes boots had snapped their laces. It was as if he'd been pulled upwards so fast they simply couldn't keep up. That worried Medium Dave. So did the smell. There was no smell at all in the rest of the tower, but just here there was a lingering odor of mushrooms. His forehead wrinkled. Medium Dave was a thief and a murderer, and therefore had a highly developed moral sense. He preferred not to steal from poor people, and not only because they never had anything worth stealing. If it was necessary to hurt anyone, he tried to leave wounds that would heal. And when, in the course of his activities, he had to kill people, then he made some effort to see that they did not suffer much, or at least made as few noises as possible. This whole business was getting on his nerves. Usually, he didn't even notice that he had any. There was a wrongness to everything that grated on his bones, and a pair of boots was all that remained of old Cat's Eye. He drew his sword. Above him, the creeping shadows moved and flowed away. Susan edged up to the entrance to the stairways and peered around into the point of a crossbow. Now, all of you, step out where I can see you," said Peachy conversationally, "and don't touch that sword, lady. You'll probably hurt yourself." Susan tried to make herself unseen and failed. Usually, it was so easy to do that that it happened automatically. Usually, with embarrassing results. She could be idly reading a book while people searched the room for her, but here, despite every effort, she seemed to remain obstinately visible. "You don't own this place," she said, stepping back. "No, but you see this crossbow. I own this crossbow. So you just walk ahead of me, right, and we'll all go and see Mister Tea Time." Excuse me, I just want to check something," said Billius. To Susan's amazement, he leaned over and touched the point of the arrow. "Yeah, what did you do that for?" said Peachy, stepping back. "I felt it, but of course, a certain amount of pain sensation would be part of a normal sensory response," said the ogod. "I warn you, there's a very good chance that I might be immortal." "Yes, but we probably aren't," said Susan. "Immortal, eh?" said Peachy. "So if I was to shoot you in the head." You wouldn't die, I suppose. When you put it like that, I do know I feel pain. Right. You just keep moving then. When something happens, said Susan, out of the corner of her mouth, you two try to get downstairs and out. All right. If the worst comes to the worst, the horse will take you out of here. If something happens, whispered the ogod. When, said Susan. Behind them, Peachy looked around. He knew he'd feel a lot better when any of the others turned up. It was almost a relief to have prisoners. Out of the corner of her eye, Susan saw something move on the stairs on the opposite side of the shaft. For a moment, she thought she saw several flashes, like metal blades catching the light. She heard a gasp behind her. The man with the crossbow was standing very still and staring at the opposite stairs. "Oh no," he said under his breath. "What is it?" said Susan. He stared at her. "You can see it too." The thing like a lot of blades clicking together," said Susan. "Oh no!" It was only there for a moment," said Susan. "It's gone now," she said. "Somewhere else," she added. "It's the Scissor Man." "Who's he?" said the Ogod. "No one," snapped Peachy, trying to pull himself together. "There's no such thing as the Scissor Man, all right?" "Ah, yes." When you were little, did you suck your thumb? Said Susan. Because the only scissor man I know is the one people used to frighten children with. They said he'd turn up and shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Said Peachy, prodding her with a crossbow. Kids believe all kinds of crap, but I'm grown up now, right? And I can open beer bottles with other people's teeth. And oh, gods!
Susan heard the snip-snip. It sounded very close now. Peachy had his eyes shut. Is there anything behind me? he quavered. Susan pushed the others aside and waved frantically towards the bottom of the stairs. No, she said as they hurried away. Is there anything standing on the stairs at all? No. Right, if you see that one-eyed bastard, you tell him he can keep the money, he turned and ran. When Susan turned to go up the stairs, the scissor man was there. It wasn't man-shaped. It was something like an ostrich and something like a lizard on its hind legs, but almost entirely like something made out of blades. Every time it moved, a thousand blades went snip, snip, snip. Its long, silver neck curved, and a head made of shears stared down at her. You're not looking for me, she said. You're not my nightmare. The blades tilted this way and that. The scissor man was trying to think. I remember you came for Twyla, said Susan, stepping forward. That damned governess had told her what happens to little girls who suck their thumbs, remember? Remember the poker? I bet you needed a hell of a lot of sharpening afterwards. The creature lowered its head, stepped carefully around her in as polite a way as it could manage, and clanked on down the stairs after Peachy. Susan ran on towards the top of the tower. Sidney put a green filter over his lantern and pressed down with a small silver rod that had an emerald set on its tip. A piece of the lock moved. There was a whirring from inside the door and something went click. He sagged with relief. It is said that the prospect of hanging concentrates the mind wonderfully, but it was Valium compared to being watched by Mr. Tea Time. I... Uh, I think that's the third lock, he said. Green light is what opens it. <laughs> I remember the famous lock of the Hall of Murgle, which could only be opened by the Hubwood Wind, although that was... I commend your expertise, said Tea Time. And the other four? Sidney looked up nervously at the silent bulk of Banjo and licked his lips. Well, of course, if I'm right and the locks depend on certain conditions, well, we could be here for years, he ventured. Supposing they can only be opened by, say, a small blonde child holding a mouse on a Tuesday in the rain. You can find out what the nature of the spell is, said Tea Time. Yes, yes, uh, of course, yes. Sidney waved his hands urgently. That's how I worked out this one. Reverse thaumaturgy. Yes, uh, certainly, um, in, in time. We have lots of time, said Tea Time. Perhaps a little more time than that, Sidney quavered. The processes are, are very... Very, very <clears throat> difficult. Oh, dear. If it's too much for you, you've only got to say, said Tea Time. No, Sidney yipped, and then managed to get some self-control. No, no, I, 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 I'm sure I shall work them out soon. Jolly good, said Tea Time. The student wizard looked down. A wisp of vapour oozed from the crack between the doors. Do you know what's um, in here, Mr. Tea Time? No. Ah, right. Sidney stared mournfully at the fourth lock. It was amazing how much he remembered when someone like Tea Time was around. He gave him a nervous look. There's not going to be any more violent deaths, are there? He said. I just can't stand the sight of violent deaths. Tea Time put a comforting arm around his shoulders. Don't worry, he said. I'm on your side. A violent death is the last thing that'll happen to you. Mr. Tea Time, he turned. Medium Dave stepped onto the landing. Someone else is in the tower, he said. They've got cat's eye. I don't know how. I've got Peachy watching the stairs, and I ain't sure where chicken wire is. Tea Time looked back to Sidney, who started prodding at the fourth lock again in a feverish attempt not to die. Why are you telling me? I thought I was paying you big, strong men a lot of money to deal with this sort of thing. Medium Dave's lips framed some words, but when he spoke, he said, All right, but what are we up against here, eh? Old man trouble or the bogeyman or what? Tea Time sighed. Some of the Tooth Fairy's employees, I assume, he said. Not if they're like the ones that were here, said Medium Dave. They were just civilians. It looks like the ground opened up and swallowed Cat's Eye up. He thought about this. I mean, the ceiling, he corrected himself. A horrible image had just passed across his underused imagination. 
Teatime walked across to the stairwell and looked down. Far below, the pile of teeth looked like a white circle. And the girl's gone, said Medium Dave. Really? I thought I said she should be killed. Medium Dave hesitated. The boys had been brought up by Ma Lillywhite to be respectful to women as delicate and fragile creatures, and were soundly thrashed if disrespectful tendencies were perceived by Ma's incredibly sensitive radar. And it was truly incredibly sensitive. Ma could hear what you were doing three rooms away. Terrible thing for a growing lad. That sort of thing leaves a mark. Ma Lillywhite certainly could. As for the others... They had no objections in practice to the disposal of anyone who got between them and large sums of money, but there was a general unspoken resentment at being told by tea time to kill someone just because he had no further use for them. It wasn't that it was unprofessional. Only assassins thought like that. It was just that there were things you did do and things you didn't do, and this was one of the things you didn't do. We thought, well, you never know. She wasn't necessary, said tea time. Few people are. Sidney thumbed hurriedly through his notebooks. "'Anyway, the place is a maze,' Medium Dave said. "'Sadly, this is so,' said Tea Time. "'But I am sure they will be able to find us. "'It's probably too much to hope that they intend something heroic.' Violet and the O-God hurried down the stairs. "'Do you know how to get back?' said Violet. "'Don't you? "'I think there's a kind of soft place. "'If you walk at it knowing it's there, you go through.' You know where it is? No, I've never been here before. They had a bag on my head when we came. All I ever did was take the teeth from under the pillows. Violet started to sob. You just get this list, and about five minutes training, and they even dock you ten pence a week for the ladder. And I know I made that mistake with little William Rubin, but they should have said you're supposed to take any teeth you... Uh, mistake, said Billius, trying to get her to hurry. Just because he slept with his head under the pillow... "'but they give you the pliers anyway. "'No one told me that you shouldn't.' "'She certainly did have a pleasant voice,' Billius told himself. "'It was just that in a funny way it grated, too. "'It was like listening to a talking flute. "'I think we'd just better get outside,' he said, "'in case they hear us,' he hinted. "'What sort of godding do you do?' said Violet. "'I, uh, oh, uh, this and that, I, uh... "'Billius tried to think through the pounding headache.' And then he had one of those ideas, the kind that only sound good after a lot of alcohol. Someone else may have drunk the drinks, but he managed to snag the idea. I'm actually self-employed, he said, as brightly as he could manage. How can you be a self-employed god? Ah, well, you see, if any other god wants, perhaps, you know, a holiday or something, I cover for them. Yeah, that's what I do. Unwisely in the circumstances, he let his inventiveness impress him. Oh, yes. I'm very busy, rushed off my feet. They're always employing me. You've no idea. They don't think twice about pushing off for a month as a big white bull or a swan or something, and it's always, oh, oh, bilious old chap, just take care of things while I'm away, will you? Answer the prayers and so on. I hardly get a minute to myself. But, of course, you can't turn down work these days. Violet was round-eyed with fascination. And are you covering for anyone right now? she asked. Er... Uh, Yes, the, um, God of Hangovers, actually. Ah, oh, God of Hangovers? How awful! Bilius looked down at his stained and wretched toga. I suppose it is, he mumbled. You're not very good at it. You don't have to tell me. You're more cut out to be one of the important gods, said Violet admiringly. I can just see you as Eo, or Fate, or one of those. Billius stared at her with his mouth open. "'I could tell at once that you weren't right,' she went on. "'Not for some horrible little god. "'You could even be offler with calves like yours.' "'Could I? "'I mean, oh, yes, yeah, sometimes. "'Of course I have to wear fangs.' "'And then someone was holding a sword to his throat. "'What's this?' said Chicken Wire. "'Lover's Lane!' "'You leave him alone, you!' shouted Violet. "'He's a god! "'You'll be really sorry!' Bilius swallowed, but very gently. It was a sharp sword. <laughs> a god, eh? <laughs> said Chicken Wire. What of? Bilius tried to swallow again. Oh, um, a bit of this, bit of that, he mumbled. Oh, said Chicken Wire. Well, I'm impressed. I can see I'm going to have to be dead careful here, eh? Don't want you smiting me with thunderbolts, do I? <laughs> Puts a crimp in the day, that sort of thing. 
Ilias didn't dare move his head, but out of the corner of his eye he was sure he could see shadows moving very fast across the walls. Dear me, <laughs> out of thunderbolts, are we? <laughs> Chicken Wire sneered. Well, you know, I've never... There was a creak. Chicken Wire's face was a few inches from Bilius. The O-God saw his expression change. The man's eyes rolled. His lips said, <sighs> Bilius risked stepping back. Chicken Wire's sword didn't move. He stood there, trembling slightly, like a man who wants to turn around to see what's behind him, but doesn't dare to, in case he does. As far as Bilius was concerned, it had just been a creak. He looked up at the thing on the landing above. Who put that there? said Violet. It was just a wardrobe. Dark oak, bit of fancy woodwork glued on in an effort to disguise the undisguisable fact that it was just an upright box. It was a wardrobe. You didn't, you know, try to cast a thunderbolt and go on a few letters too many, she went on. Huh? said Bilius, looking from the stricken man to the wardrobe. It was so ordinary, it was odd. I mean, thunderbolts begin with tea, and wardrobes... Violet's lips moved silently. Part of Bilius thought, I'm attracted to a girl who actually has to shut down all other brain functions in order to think about the order of the letters of the alphabet. On the other hand, she's attracted to someone who's wearing a toga that looks as though a family of weasels have had a party in it, so maybe I'll stop this thought right here. But the major part of his brain thought, Why is this man making little bubbling noises? It's just a wardrobe, for my sake. No, no, mumbled Chicken Wire. I don't wanna. The sword clanged to the floor. He took a step backwards up the stairs, but very slowly, as if he was doing it despite every effort his muscles could muster. Don't want to do what? said Violet. Chicken Wire spun round. Bilius had never seen that happen before. People turned round quickly, yes, but Chicken Wire just revolved as if some giant hand had been placed on his head and twisted a hundred and eighty degrees. No, 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 Chicken Wire whined. No, he tottered up the steps. You've got to help me, he whispered. What's the matter, said Bilius. It's just a wardrobe, isn't it? It's for putting all your old clothes in so that there's no room for your new clothes. The doors of the wardrobe swung open. Chicken Wire managed to thrust out his arms and grab the sides, and for a moment he stood quite still. Then he was pulled into the wardrobe in one sudden movement, and the doors slammed shut. The little brass key turned in the lock with a click. We ought to get him out, said the O-God, running up the steps. Why? Violet demanded. They are not very nice people. I know that one. When he brought me food, he made... suggestive comments. Yes, but... Bilius hadn't ever seen a face like that outside of a mirror. Chicken Wire had looked very, very sick. He turned the key and opened the doors. Oh, dear. I don't want to see. I don't want to see, said Violet, looking over his shoulder. Bilius reached down and picked up a pair of boots that stood neatly in the middle of the wardrobe's floor. Then he put them back carefully and walked round the wardrobe. It was plywood. The words... Dratley and Sons, Phaedra Road, Ankh Morpork, was stamped in one corner in faded ink. Is it magic? said Violet, nervously. I don't know if something magic has the maker's name on it, said Bilius. There are magic wardrobes, said Violet, nervously. If you go into them, you come out in a magic land. Bilius looked at the boots again. Uh, yes, he said. I think I must tell you something said Death. Yes, I think you should, said Ridcully. I've got little devils running around the place eating socks and pencils. Earlier tonight we sobered up someone who thinks he's a god of hangovers, and half my wizards are trying to cheer up the cheerful fairy. We thought something must have happened to the Hogfather. We were right, right? Hex was right, Arch-Chancellor, Ponder corrected him. Hex? What is Hex? Uh... Hex thinks, that is, calculates, that there's been a big change in the nature of belief today, said Ponder. He felt, he did not know why, that death was probably not in favour of unliving things that thought. Mr. Hex was remarkably astute. The Hogfather has been... Death paused. There is no sensible human word. Dead in a way, but not exactly. A god cannot be killed, never completely killed. He has been, shall we say, severely reduced. 
"'Ye gods!' said Ridcully. "'Who'd want to kill off the old boy? "'He has enemies!' "'What did he do? "'Miss a chimney? "'Every living thing has enemies. "'What, everything? "'Yes, everything. "'Powerful enemies, but they have gone too far this time. "'Now they are using people. "'Who are? "'Those who think the universe should be a lot of rocks moving in curbs. "'Have you ever heard of the auditors?' "'I suppose the bursar may have done. "'Not auditors of money, auditors of reality. "'They think of life as a stain on the universe, a pestilence, messy, getting in the way.' "'In the way of what?' "'The efficient running of the universe.' "'I thought it was uh, run for us. "'Well, for the Professor of Applied Anthropics, actually.' "'But we're allowed to tag along,' said Ridcully. "'He scratched his chin. "'And I could certainly run a marvellous university here "'if only we didn't have to have these damn students underfoot all the time.' "'Quite so. "'They want to get rid of us. "'They want you to be less... "'Damn, I've forgotten the word. "'Untruthful. "'The Hogfather is a symbol of this.' "'Death snapped his fingers, "'causing echoes to bounce off the walls, "'and added... "'Wistful, lying!' "'Untruthful?' said Ridcully. "'Me? I'm as honest as the day is long. "'Yes, what is it this time?' "'Ponder had tugged at his robe, and now he whispered something in his ear. "'Ridcully cleared his throat. "'I am reminded that this is, in fact, the shortest day of the year,' he said. "'However, this does not undermine the point that I just made, "'although I thank my colleague for his invaluable support "'and constant readiness to correct minor, if not downright trivial, errors. "'I am a remarkably truthful man, sir. "'Things said at university council meetings don't count. "'I mean humanity in general. "'Er, uh, the act of telling the universe it is other than it is.' Eh, yeah, you've got me there,' said Ridcully. "'Anyway, why are you doing the job?' "'Someone must. It is vitally important. They must be seen and believed. Before dawn there must be enough belief in the Hogfather.' "'Why?' said Ridcully. "'So that the sun will come up.' The two wizards gawped at him. "'I seldom joke,' said Death, at which point there was a scream of horror. "'That sounded like the purser,' said Ridcully, "'and he's been doing so well up to now.' "'The reason for the bursar's scream lay on the floor of his bedroom. "'It was a man. He was dead. "'No one alive had that kind of expression. "'Some of the other wizards had got there first. "'Ridcully pushed his way through the crowd. "'Ye gods,' he said, "'what a face! "'He looks as though he died of fright. "'What happened?' "'Well,' said the dean, "'as far as I can tell, the bursar opened his wardrobe "'and found the man inside.' Really? I wouldn't have said the poor old bursar was all that frightening. No arch-chancellor, the corpse, fell out on him. The bursar was standing in the corner, wearing his old familiar expression of good-humoured concussion. You all right, old fellow? said Ridcully. What's eleven per cent of one thousand two hundred and seventy-six? One hundred and forty point three six, said the bursar promptly. Ah, right as rain, said Ridcully cheerfully. "'I don't see why,' said the Chair of Indefinite Studies. "'Just because he can do things with numbers doesn't mean everything else is fine.' "'Doesn't need to be,' said Ridcully. "'Numbers is what he has to do. "'The poor chap might be slightly yo-yo, but I've been reading about it. "'He's one of these idiot servants.' "'Savant,' said the Dean, patiently. "'The word is savant, Ridcully. "'Whatever!' Those chaps who can tell you what day of the week the first of Groon was a hundred years ago. Tuesday, said the burster, but can't tie their bootlaces, said Ridcully. What was a corpse doing in his wardrobe, and no one is to say not a lot, or anything tasteless like that? Haven't had a corpse in a wardrobe since that business with Arch-Chancellor Buckleby. We all warned Buckleby that the lock was too stiff, said the Dean. Just out of interest... "'Why was the bursar fiddling with his wardrobe at this time of night?' said Ridcully. "'The wizards looked sheepish. "'We were playing sardines, Arch-Chancellor,' said the dean. "'What's that?' "'It's like hide-and-seek, but when you find someone you have to squeeze in with them,' said the dean. "'I 
Hmm. I just want to be clear about this," said Redcully. "My senior wizards have spent the evening playing hide and seek." "Oh,、uh, not the whole evening," said the chair of indefinite studies. "We played grandmother's footsteps and I spy for quite a while until the senior wrangler made a scene just because we wouldn't let him spell chandelier with an S." "Party games, you fellers," the dean sidled closer. It's Miss Smith," he mumbled. "When we don't join in, she bursts into tears." "Who's Miss Smith?" "The cheerful fairy," said the lecturer in recent runes glumly. "If you don't say yes to everything, her lip wobbles like a plate of jelly. It's unbearable." "We just joined in to stop her weeping," said the dean. "It's amazing how one woman can be so soggy." "If we're not cheerful, she bursts into tears." Said the chair of indefinite studies. The senior wrangler is doing some juggling for her at the moment. But he can't juggle. I think that's cheering her up a bit. What you're telling me then is that my wizards are prancing round, playing children's games just to cheer up some dejected fairy. Er,、uh, yes. I thought you had to clap your hands and say you believed in 'em," said Ridcully. "Correct me if I'm wrong." That's just for the little shiny ones," said the lecturer in recent runes. "Not for the ones in saggy cardigans with half a dozen hankies stuffed up their sleeves." Ridcully looked at the corpse again. "Hmm. Anyone know who he is? Looks a bit of a ruffian to me. And where's his boots, may I ask?" The dean took a small glass cube from his pocket and ran it over the corpse. "Quite a large thalmic reading, gentlemen," he said. "I think he got here by magic." He rummaged in the man's pockets and pulled out a handful of small white things. "Ugh," he said. "Teeth," said Ridcully. "Who goes around with a pocket full of teeth?" "Er,、uh, a very bad fighter," said the chair of indefinite studies. "I'll go and get Modo to take the poor fellow away, shall I? If we can get a reading off the thalmometer, perhaps Hex." Ridcully began. "Now, Ridcully," said the dean. I really think there must be some problems that can be resolved without having to deal with that damn thinking mill. Death looked up at Hex. A machine for thinking? Ah,、uh, yes, sir," said Ponder Stibbons. "You see, when you said, well, you see, Hex believes everything, but look, the sun really will come up, won't it? That's its job. Leave us." Ponder backed away and then scurried out of the room. The ants flowed along their tubes. Cog wheels spun. The big wheel with the sheep skulls on it creaked around slowly. A mouse squeaked somewhere in the works. Well, said Death. After a while, the pen began to write. Plus plus plus. Big red lever time. Plus plus plus. Query plus plus plus. No, they say you are a thinker. Extend logically the result of the human race ceasing to believe in the Hogfather. Will the sun come up? Answer. It took several minutes. The wheels spun. The ants ran. The mouse squeaked. An egg timer came down on a spring. It bounced aimlessly for a while and then jerked back up again. Hex wrote, "Plus plus plus, the sun will not come up." Plus plus plus. Correct. How may this be prevented? Answer. Plus plus plus. Regular and consistent belief. Plus plus plus. Good. I have a task for you, thinking engine. Plus plus plus. Yes, I am preparing an area of write-only memory. Plus plus plus. What is that? Plus plus plus. You would say to know in your bones. Plus plus plus. Good. Here is your instruction. Believe in the Hogfather. Plus 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 yes plus plus plus. Do you believe? Answer. Plus 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 yes plus plus plus. Do you believe? Answer. Plus 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 yes plus plus plus. There was a change in the assembled heap of pipes and tubes that was hex. The big wheel creaked into a new position. From the other side of the wall came the hum of busy bees. Good. Death turned to leave the room, but stopped when Hex began to write furiously. He went back and looked at the emerging paper. 
plus 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 dear hog father for hog's watch i want oh no you can't write letter death paused and then said you can can't you plus 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 yes i am entitled plus 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 death waited until the pen had stopped and picked up the paper but you are a machine things have no desires a doorknob wants nothing even though it is a complex machine plus 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 all things strive plus 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 you have a point said death he thought of tiny red petals in the black depths and read to the end of the list i don't know what most of these things are i don't think the sack will either plus 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 i regret this plus 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 but we will do the best we can said death frankly i shall be glad when tonight's over it's much harder to give than to receive he rummaged in his sack let me see how old are you susan crept up the stairs one hand on the hilt of the sword ponder stibbins had been worried to find himself as a wizard awaiting the arrival of the hogfather It's amazing how people define roles for themselves and put handcuffs on their experience and are constantly surprised by the things a roulette universe spins at them. Here am I, they say, a mere wholesale fishmonger at the controls of a giant airliner because as it turns out all the crew had the coronation chicken. Who'd have thought it? Here am I, a housewife who merely went out this morning to bank the proceeds of the playgroup association's car boot sale on the run with 1 million in stolen cash and a rather handsome man from the battery chickens liberation organization amazing here am i a perfectly ordinary hockey player suddenly realizing i'm the son of god with 500 devoted followers in a nice little commune in empowerment southern california who'd have thought it here am i thought susan a very practically minded governess who can add up faster upside down than most people can the right way up climbing up a tooth-shaped tower belonging to the tooth fairy and armed with a sword belonging to death again i wish one month just one damn month could go by without something like this happening to me she could hear voices above her someone said something about a lock she peered over the edge of the stairwell it looked as though people had been camping out up there there were boxes and sleeping rolls strewn around a couple of men were sitting on boxes watching a third man who was working on a door in one curved wall one of the men was the biggest susan had ever seen one of those huge fat men who contrived to indicate that a lot of the fat under their shapeless clothes is muscle the other hello said a cheerful voice by her ear what's your name she made herself turn her head slowly first she saw the gray glinting eye then the yellow white one with the tiny dot of a pupil came into view Around them was a friendly pink and white face topped by curly hair. It was actually quite pretty in a boyish sort of way, except that those mismatched eyes staring out of it suggested that it had been stolen from somewhere else. She started to move her hand, but the boy was there first, dragging the sword scabbard out of her belt. "Ah uh ah," -uh, he chided, turning and fending her off as she tried to grab it. "Well, well, well, my word. White bone handle, rather tasteless skull and bone decoration." Death himself second favorite weapon am i right oh my this must be hogswatch and this must mean that you are susan stow hellet no ability i'd bow he added dancing back but i'm afraid you'd do something dreadful there was a click and a little gasp of excitement from the wizard working on the door yes yes left-handed using a wooden pick that simple he saw that even susan was looking at him and coughed nervously uh I've got the fifth lock open, Mister T. R. T. M. E. Not a problem. They're just based on Waddley's occult sequence. Any fool could do it if they knew that. I know it," said T. Time, without taking his eyes off Susan. Ah. It was not technically audible, but nevertheless, Susan could almost hear the wizard's mind backpedaling. Up ahead was the conclusion that T. Time had no time for people he didn't need. With uh, interesting um, subtleties," he said slowly. "Yes, um, very tricky. I'll, I'll I'll just have to have a look at number six. How do you know who I am?" said Susan. "Oh, easy. Tea time. Twerps peerage. Family motto: Non temetis messor. We have to read it, you know, in class. 
Old Merisette calls it the guide to the turf. No one laughs except him, of course. Oh, yes, I know about you. Quite a lot. Your father was well known, went a long way very fast. As for your grandfather, honestly, that motto, is that good taste? Of course, you don't need to fear him, do you? Or do you? Susan tried to fade. It didn't work. She could feel herself staying embarrassingly solid. I don't know what you're talking about, she said. Who are you, anyway? I beg your pardon. My name is Teatime. Jonathan Teatime. At your service. Susan lined up the syllables in her head. You mean, like around four o'clock in the afternoon, she said. No, I did say Teatime, said Tea Time. I spoke very clearly. Please don't try to break my concentration by annoying me. I only get annoyed at important things. How are you getting on, Mr. Sidney? If it's just according to Waddle's sequence number six, should be copper and blue-green light. Unless, of course, there are any, ha, huh, subtleties. Um, doing all right now, Mr. Teatime. Do you think your grandfather will try to rescue you? Do you think he will? But now I have his sword, you see. I wonder... There was another click. Sixth lock, Mr. Teatime. Really? Uh, don't you want me to start on the seventh? Oh, well, if you like. Pure white light will be the key, said Tea Time, still not looking away from Susan. But it may not be all important now. Thank you, anyway. You've been most helpful. Uh, yes. You may go. Susan noticed that Sidney didn't even bother to pick up his books and tools, but hurried down the stairs as if he expected to be called back, and was trying to run faster than the sound. Is that all you're here for? she said. A robbery? He was dressed like an assassin, after all, and there was always one way to annoy an assassin. Like a thief? Tea Time danced excitedly. A thief? Me? I'm not a thief, madam, but if I were, I would be the kind that steals fire from the gods. We've already got fire. There must be an upgrade by now. No, these gentlemen are thieves, common robbers. Decent types, although you wouldn't necessarily want to watch them eat, for example. That's Medium Dave, and Exhibit B is Banjo. He can talk. Medium Dave nodded at Susan. She saw the look in his eyes. Maybe there was something she could use. She'd need something. Even her hair was a mess. She couldn't step behind time. She couldn't fade into the background. And now even her hair had let her down. She was normal. Here, she was what she'd always wanted to be. Bloody, bloody damn. Sidney prayed as he ran down the stairs. He didn't believe in any gods, since most wizards seldom like to encourage them, but he prayed anyway the fervent prayers of an atheist who hopes to be wrong. But no one called him back, and no one ran after him. So, being of a serious turn of mind under his normal state of subcritical fear, he slowed down in case he lost his footing. It was then that he noticed that the steps underfoot weren't the smooth whiteness they had been everywhere else, but were very large pitted flagstones. And the light had changed. And then they weren't stairs any more, and he staggered as he encountered flat ground where steps should have been. His outstretched hand brushed against a crumbling brick, and the ghosts of the past poured in, and he knew where he was. He was in the yard of Gamma Wimbledon's Dame School. His mother wanted him to learn his letters and be a wizard, but she also thought that long curls on a five-year-old boy looked very smart. This was the hunting ground of Ronnie Jenks. Adult memory and understanding said that Ronnie was just an unintelligent bullet-headed seven-year-old bully with muscles where his brain should have been. The eye of childhood, rather more accurately, dreaded him as a force like a personalised earthquake with one nostril bunged up with bogies both knees scabbed, both fists bald, and all five brain cells concentrated in a kind of cerebral grunt. Oh, gods. There was the tree Ronnie used to hide behind. It looked as big and menacing as he remembered it. But if somehow he'd ended up back there, gods knew how, well, he might be a bit on the skinny side, but he was a damn sight bigger than Ronnie Jenks now. Gods, yes. He'd kick those evil little trousers, all the... And then, as a shadow blotted out the sun, he realised he was wearing curls. Tea Time looked thoughtfully at the door. I suppose I should open it, he said, after coming all this way. You are controlling children by their teeth, said Susan. 
It does sound odd, doesn't it, when you put it like that, said Tea Time, but that's sympathetic magic for you. Is your grandfather going to try to rescue you, do you think? But no, I don't think he can. Not here, I think. I don't think that he can come here. So he sent you, did he? Certainly not. He... Susan stopped. Oh, he had, she told herself, feeling even more of a fool. He certainly had. He was learning about humans all right. For a walking skeleton, he could be quite clever. But how clever was tea time? Just a bit too excited at his cleverness to realize that if death... She tried to stamp on the thought, just in case tea time could read it in her eyes. I don't think he'll try, she said. He's not as clever as you, Mr. Tea Time. Te atime, said Tea Time automatically. That's a shame. Do you think you're going to get away with this? Oh, dear. Do people really say that? And suddenly Tea Time was much closer. I've got away with it. No more Hogfather. And that's only the start. We'll keep the teeth coming in, of course. Hm. The possibilities. There was a rumble like an avalanche, a long way off. The dormant banjo had awakened, causing tremors in his lower slopes. His enormous hands, which had been resting on his knees, started to bunch. <coughs> What's this? he said. Tea time stopped and for a moment looked puzzled. What's this what? You said no more hog, father, said Banjo. He stood up like a mountain range rising gently in the squeeze between colliding continents. His hands still stayed in the vicinity of his knees. Tea Time stared at him and then glanced at Medium Dave. He does know what we've been doing, does he? He said. You did tell him. Medium Dave shrugged. There's got to be a hog father, said Banjo. There's always a hog father. Susan looked down. Grey blotches were speeding across the white marble. She was standing in a pool of grey. So was Banjo. And around tea time the dots bounced and recoiled like wasps around a pot of jam. Looking for something, she thought. You don't believe in the Hogfather, do you? said tea time. A big boy like you? Yeah, said Banjo. So what's this no more Hogfather? Tea time pointed at Susan. She did it, he said. She killed him. The sheer playground effrontery of it shocked Susan. No, I didn't, she said. He did, didn't, did. Banjo's big, bald head turned towards her. What's this about the hog father? he said. I don't think he's dead, said Susan, but tea time has made him very ill. Who cares, said tea time, dancing away. When this is over, Banjo, you'll have as many presents as you want, trust me. There's got to be a hog father, Banjo rumbled. Else there's no hog's watch. It's just another solar festival, said Tea Time. It... Medium Dave stood up. He had his hand on his sword. We're going, Tea Time, he said. Me and Banjo are going. I don't like any of this. I don't mind robbing, I don't mind thieving, but this isn't honest. Banjo, you come with me right now. What's this about no more hog father? said Banjo. Tea Time pointed to Susan. You grab her, Banjo. It's all her fault. Banjo lumbered a few steps in Susan's direction and then stopped. Our mum said no hitting girls, he rumbled. No pulling their hair. Tea Time rolled his one good eye. Around his feet, the greyness seemed to be boiling in the stone, following his feet as they moved. And it was around Banjo, too. Searching, Susan thought, it's looking for a way in. I think I know you, Tea Time, she said, as sweetly as she could, for Banjo's sake. You're the mad kid they're all scared of, right? Banjo, snapped Tea Time, I said, grab her. Our mam said, the giggling excitable one, even the bullies never touched, because if they did, he went insane and kicked and bit, said Susan. The kid who didn't know the difference between chucking a stone at a cat and setting it on fire. To her delight, he glared at her. Shut up. He said, I bet no one wanted to play with you, said Susan, not the kid with no friends. Kids know about a mind like yours, even if they don't know the right words for it. I said, shut up, get her, Banjo. That was it. She could hear it in Tea Time's voice. There was a touch of vibrato that hadn't been there before. 
The kind of little boy, she said, watching his face, who looks up dolls' dresses. I didn't. Banjo looked worried. Our ma'am said. Oh, to blazes with your ma'am, snapped Tea Time. There was a whisper of steel. Medium Dave drew his sword. What did you say about our ma'am? He whispered. Now he's having to concentrate on three people. Susan thought. I bet no one ever played with you, she said. I bet there were things people had to hush up. Hmm. Banjo, you do what I tell you. Tea Time screamed. The monstrous man was beside her now. She could see his face twisted in an agony of indecision. His enormous fists clenched and unclenched, and his lips moved as some kind of horrible debate raged in his head. Our, our ma'am, our ma'am said. The grey marks flowed across the floor and formed a pool of shadow which grew darker and higher with astonishing speed. It towered over the three men and grew a shape. Have you been a bad boy, you little perisher? The huge woman towered over all three men. In one meaty hand, it was holding a bundle of birch twigs as thick as a man's arm. The thing growled. Medium Dave looked up into the enormous face of Ma Lillywhite. Every pore was a pothole. Every brown tooth was a tombstone. You been letting him get into trouble, our Davy? You have, ain't you? He backed away. No, mum. No, mum. You need a good hiding, Banjo. You been playing with the girls again? Banjo sagged onto his knees, tears of misery rolling down his face. Sorry, mum. Sorry, sorry, mum. No, mum. Sorry, sorry, mum. Then the figure turned to Medium Dave again. The sword dropped out of his hand. His face seemed to melt. Medium Dave started to cry. No, mum. <laughs> No, mum. No, mum. He gave a gurgle and collapsed, clutching his chest, and vanished. Tea time started to laugh. Susan tapped him on the shoulder, and as he looked round, hit him as hard as she could across the face. That was the plan, at least. His hand moved faster and caught her wrist. It was like striking an iron bar. Oh no, he said. I don't think so. Out of the corner of her eyes, Susan saw Banjo crawling across the floor to where his brother had been. Ma Lillywhite had vanished. This place gets into your head, doesn't it? Tea Time said. It pokes around to find out how to deal with you. Well, I'm in touch with my inner child. He reached out with his other hand and grabbed her hair, pulling her head down. Susan screamed, and it's much more fun. He whispered. Susan felt his grip lessen. There was a wet thump, like a piece of steak hitting a slab, and Tea Time went past her on his back. No pulling girls' hair," rumbled Banjo. "That's bad." Tea Time bounced up like an acrobat and steadied himself on the railing of the stairwell. Then he drew the sword. The blade was invisible in the bright light of the tower. "It's true what the stories say," then he said. "So thin you can't see it. I'm going to have such fun with it." He waved it at them. "So light, you wouldn't dare use it. My grandfather will come after you," said Susan, walking towards him. She saw one eye twitch. He comes after everyone, but I'll be ready for him," said Tea Time. "He's very single-minded," said Susan, closer now. "Ah,、uh, a man after my own heart. Could be Mister Tea Time." He brought the sword round. She didn't even have time to duck, and she didn't even try to when he swung the sword back again. "It doesn't work here," she said, as he stared at it in astonishment. "The blade doesn't exist here." There's no death here," she slapped him across the face. "Hi," she said brightly. "I'm the inner babysitter." She didn't punch. She just thrust out an arm, palm first, catching him under the chin and lifting him backwards over the rail. He somersaulted. She never knew how. He somehow managed to gain purchase on clear air. His free arm grabbed at hers. Her feet came off the ground, and she was over the rail. She caught it with her other hand. Although later she wondered if the rail hadn't managed to catch her instead, Tea Time swung from her arm, staring upwards with a thoughtful expression. She saw him grip the sword hilt in his teeth and reach down to his belt. The question, "Is this person mad enough to try to kill someone holding him?" was asked and answered very, very fast. She kicked down and hit him on the ear. The cloth of her sleeve began to tear. Tea Time tried to get another grip. She kicked again, and the dress ripped. For an instant, he held on to nothing, and then, still wearing the expression of someone trying to solve a complex problem, he fell away, spinning, getting smaller. 
He hit the pile of teeth, sending them splashing across the marble. He jerked for a moment and vanished. A hand like a bunch of bananas pulled Susan back over the rail. You can get into trouble hitting girls, said Banjo. No playing with girls. There was a click behind him. The doors had swung open. Cold white mist rolled out across the floor. Our ma'am, said Banjo, trying to work things out. Our ma'am was here. Yes, said Susan. But it weren't our ma'am, cause they buried our ma'am. Yes. We watched them fill in the grave and everything. Yes, said Susan, and added to herself, I bet you did. And where's our Davy gone? Uh, somewhere else, Banjo. Somewhere nice, said the huge man, hesitantly. Susan grasped with relief the opportunity to tell the truth, or at least not definitely lie. It could be, she said. Better than here? You never know. Some people would say the odds are in favour. Banjo turned his pink piggy eyes on her. For a moment, a thirty-five-year-old man looked out through the pink clouds of a five-year-old face. That's good, he said. He'll be able to see our ma'am again. This much conversation seemed to exhaust him. He sagged. I want to go home, he said. She stared at his big, stained face, shrugged hopelessly, pulled a handkerchief out of her pocket and held it up to his mouth. Spit, she commanded. He obeyed. She dabbed the handkerchief over the worst parts and then tucked it into his hand. Have a good blow, she suggested, and then carefully leaned out of range until the echoes of the blast had died away. You can keep the hanky. Please, she added, meaning it wholeheartedly. Now, tuck your shirt in. Yes, miss. Now, go downstairs and sweep all the teeth out of the circle. Can you do that? Banjo nodded. What can you do? Susan prompted. Banjo concentrated. Sweep all the teeth out of the circle, miss. Good. Off you go. Susan watched him plod off and then looked at the white doorway. She was sure the wizard had only got as far as the sixth lock. The room beyond the door was entirely white, and the mist that swirled at knee level deadened even the sound of her footsteps. All there was was a bed. It was a large four-poster, old and dusty. She thought it was unoccupied, and then she saw the figure lying among the mounds of pillows. It looked very much like a frail old lady in a mob cap. The old woman turned her head and smiled at Susan. Hello, my dear. Susan couldn't remember a grandmother. Her father's mother had died when she was young, and the other side of the family, well, she'd never had a grandmother. But this was the sort she would have wanted. The kind, the nasty realistic side of her mind said, that hardly ever existed. Susan thought she heard a child laugh, and another one. Somewhere, almost out of hearing, children were at play. It was always a pleasant lulling sound, always provided, of course, you couldn't hear the actual words. No, said Susan. Sorry, dear, said the old lady. You're not the tooth fairy. Oh, no. There was even a damn patchwork quilt. Oh, I am, dear. Oh, Grandma, what big teeth you have. Good grief, you've even got a shawl. Oh, dear. I don't understand, lovey. You forgot the rocking chair, said Susan. I always thought there'd be a rocking chair. There was a pop behind her and then a dying creak creak. She didn't even turn round. If you've included a kitten playing with a ball of wool, it'll go very hard with you, she said sternly and picked up the candlestick by the bed. It seemed heavy enough. I don't think you're real, she said levelly. There's not a little old woman in a shawl running this place. You are out of my head. That's how you defend yourself. You poke around in people's heads and find the things that work. She swung the candlestick. It passed through the figure in the bed. See, she said, you're not even real. Oh, I am real, dear, said the old woman as her outline changed. The candlestick wasn't. Susan looked down at the new shape. Nope, she said, it's horrible, but it doesn't frighten me. No, nor does that. It changed again and again. No, <laughs> nor does my father. Good grief, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel, aren't you? I like spiders. Snakes don't worry me. Dogs? No. Rats are fine. I like rats. Sorry, is anyone frightened of that? She grabbed at the thing, and this time the shape stayed. It looked like a small wizened monkey, but with deep, big eyes under a brow overhanging like a balcony. 
Its hair was grey and lank. It struggled weakly in her grasp and wheezed. I don't frighten easily, said Susan, but you'd be amazed at how angry I can become. The creature hung limp. I, er,、uh, it muttered. She let it down again. You're a bogey man, aren't you? She said. It collapsed in a heap when she took her hand away. Not a V, it said. What do you mean, V? Said Susan. V, bogey man. Said the bogey man, and she saw how rangy it was, how white and grey streaked its hair, how the skin was stretched over the bones. The first bogey man, I, there were, I do remember when the land was different, ice, many times of ice, and the what do you call them? The creature wheezed. The lands, the big lands. All different. Susan sat down on the bed. You mean continents? All different. The black sunken eyes glinted at her, and suddenly the thing reared up, bony arms waving. I was the dark in the cave. I was the shadow in the trees. You've heard about the primal scream? Hmm. That was at me. I was. It folded up and started coughing. And then, <laughs> that thing, <laughs> you know, that thing, all light and bright, lightning you could carry, hot little sunshine, and then there was no more dark, just shadows, and then you made axes, axes in the forest, and then, and then, Susan sat down on the bed. There's still plenty of bogey men, she said. Hiding under the beds, lurking in the cupboards, but it fought for breath. If you had seen me in the old days, when they came down into the deep caves to draw their hunting pictures, I could roar in their heads so that their stomachs dropped out of their bottoms. All the old skills are dying out," said Susan gravely. Oh, others came later. They never knew that first fine terror. All they knew, even whispering, the bogeyman managed to get a sneer in its voice. Was dark corners. I had been the dark. I was the first. And now I was no better than them, frightening maids. Curdling cream, hiding in shadows at the stub of the year, and then one night I thought, why? Susan nodded. Bogey men weren't bright. The moment of existential uncertainty probably took a lot longer in heads where the brain cells bounced so very slowly from one side of the skull to the other. But Grandad had thought like that. You hung around with humans long enough, and you stopped being what they imagined you to be, and wanted to become something of your own: umbrellas and silver hairbrushes. You thought, "What was the point of it all?" She said, "Frightening children, lurking, and then I started to watch them. Didn't really used to be children back in the ice times; just big humans, little humans." Not children, and and there was a different world in their heads. In their heads, that's where the old days were. Now, the old days, when it was all young. You came out from under the bed. I watched over them, kept them safe. Susan tried not to shudder. And the teeth? I. Oh, you can't leave teeth around. Anyone might get them. Do terrible things. I liked them. I didn't want anyone to hurt them. It bubbled. I never wanted to hurt them. I just used to watch. I kept the teeth all safe, and 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 sometimes I just sit here listening to them. It mumbled on. Susan listened in embarrassed amazement, not knowing whether to take pity on the thing or—and this was a developing option—to tread on it. 
and the teeth. They remember. It started to shake. The money, Susan prompted. I don't see many rich bogeymen around. Money everywhere, buried in holes, old treasure back of sofas. It adds up. Investments, money for the tooth, very important part of the magic, makes it safe, makes it proper. Otherwise, it's thieving. And I labelled them all and kept them safe, and and then I was old. But I found people. The tooth fairy sniggered, and for a moment Susan felt sorry for the men in the ancient caves. They don't ask questions, do they? It bubbled. You give 'em money, and they all do their jobs, and they don't ask questions. It's more than their jobs worth, said Susan. And then they came stealing. Susan gave in. Old gods do new jobs. You look terrible. Thank you very much. I mean, ill, very old. All those men, too much effort. The bogeyman groaned. You, you don't die here. It panted. Just get old, listening to the laughter. Susan nodded. It was in the air. She couldn't hear words, just a distant chatter, as if it was at the other end of a long corridor. In this place. He grew up round me, the trees said Susan, and the sky, out of their heads, dying. The little children, you've got to. The figure faded. Susan sat for a while, listening to the distant chatter. Worlds of belief, she thought, just like oysters. A little piece of shit gets in, and then a pearl grows up around it. She got up and went downstairs. Banjo had found a broom and mop somewhere. The circle was empty, and with surprising initiative, the man was carefully washing the chalk away. Banjo, yes, miss. You like it here? There's trees, miss. That probably counts as a yes. Susan decided. The sky doesn't worry you. He looked at her in puzzlement. No, miss. Can you count, Banjo? He looked smug. Yes, miss. On my fingers, miss. So you can count up to. Susan prompted. Thirteen, miss," said Banjo proudly. She looked at his big hands. Good grief! Well, she thought, and why not? He's big and trustworthy, and what other kind of life has he got? I think it would be a good idea if you did the tooth fairy's job, Banjo. Will that be all right, miss? Will the tooth fairy mind? You do it until she comes back. All right, miss. I'll um. Get people to keep an eye on you until you get settled in. I think food comes in on the cart. You're not to let people cheat you. She looked at his hands and then up and up at the lower slopes until she saw the peak of Mount Banjo and added, "Not that I think they'll try, mind you." Yes, Miss. I will keep things tidy, Miss. Er,、uh, the big pink face looked at her. Yes, Banjo. Can I have a puppy, Miss? I had a kitten once, Miss, but our mam drowned it 'cause it was dirty. Susan's memory threw up a name, a puppy called Spot. Yes, Miss Spot, Miss. I think it'll turn up quite soon, Banjo. He seemed to take this entirely on trust. Thank you, Miss. And now I've got to go. Right, Miss. She looked back up the tower. Death's land might be dark, but when you were there, you never thought anything bad was going to happen to you. You were beyond the places where it could. But here, when you were grown up, you only feared well, logical things, poverty, illness, being found out. At least you weren't mad with terror because of something under the stairs. The world wasn't full of arbitrary light and shade. The wonderful world of childhood. <laughs> well, it wasn't a cut-down version of the adult one. That was certain. It was more like the adult one, written in big, heavy letters. Everything was more, more everything. She left Banjo to his sweeping and stepped out into the perpetually sunlit world. Billius and Violet hurried towards her. Billius was waving a branch like a club. "You don't need that," said Susan. She wanted some sleep. "We talked about it, and we thought we ought to come back and help," said Billius. "Ah, democratic courage," said Susan. "Well, they're all gone." To wherever they go, 
Ilias lowered the branch, thankfully. It wasn't that... he began. Look, you two can make yourselves useful, said Susan. There's a mess in there. Go and help Banjo. Banjo? He's more or less running the place now. Violet laughed. <laughs> but he's... He's in charge, said Susan wearily. All right, said Billius. Anyway, I'm sure we can tell him what to do. No. Too many people have told him what to do. He knows what to do. Just help him get started, all right? But if the Hogfather comes back now, you'll vanish, won't you? She didn't know how to phrase the question. I'm uh, giving up my old job, said Billius. Uh, I'm going to go on working as a holiday relief for the other gods. He gave her a pleading look. Really? Susan looked at Violet. Oh, well, maybe if she believes in him at least. It might work. You never know. Good, she said. Have fun. Now I'm going home. This is a hell of a way to spend Hogswatch. She found Binky waiting by the stream. The auditors fluttered anxiously. And as always happens in their species when something goes radically wrong and needs fixing instantly, they settled down to try and work out who was to blame. One said, It was, and then it stopped. The auditors lived by consensus, which made picking scapegoats a little problematical. It brightened up. After all, if everyone was to blame, then it was no one's actual fault. That's what collective responsibility meant, after all. It was more like bad luck or something. Another said, Unfortunately, people might get the wrong idea. We may be asked questions. One said, What about death? He interfered, after all. One said, Uh, not exactly. One said, Oh, come on, he got the girl involved. One said, Uh, no, she got herself involved. One said, Yes, but he told her. One said, No, he didn't. In fact, he specifically did not tell. It paused and then said, Damn. One said, On the other hand... The robes turned towards it. Yes? One said, There's no actual evidence. Nothing written down. Some humans got excited and decided to attack the Tooth Fairy's country. This is unfortunate, but nothing to do with us. We are shocked, of course. One said... There's still the Hogfather. Things are going to be noticed. Questions may be asked. They hovered for a while, unspeaking. Eventually one said, We may have to take... It paused, loath even to think the word, but managed to continue. A risk. Bed, thought Susan, as the mists rolled past her, and in the morning decent human things like coffee and porridge. And bed. Real things. Binky stopped. She stared at his ears for a moment and then urged him forward. He whinnied and didn't budge. A skeletal hand had grabbed his bridle. Death materialized. It is not over. More must be done. They torment him still. Susan sagged. What is? Who are? Move forward. I will steer. Death climbed into the saddle and reached around her for the reins. Look, I went, Susan began. Yes, I know, the control of belief, said Death, as the horse moved forward again. Only a very simple mind could think of that. Magic so old, it's hardly magic. What a simple way to make millions of children cease to believe in the Hogfather. And what were you doing? Susan demanded. I too have done what I set out to do. I have kept a space. A million carpets with sooty boot marks, millions of filled stockings, all those roofs with runner marks on them. Disbelief will find it hard going in the face of all that. Albert says he never wants to drink another sherry for days. The Hogfather will have something to come back to, at least. What have I got to do now? You must bring the Hogfather back. Oh, must I? For peace and goodwill and the tinkling of fairy bells? Who cares? He's just some fat old clown who makes people feel smug at Hogswatch. I've been through all this for some old man who prowls around kids' bedrooms. No, so that the sun will rise. What has astronomy got to do with the Hogsfather? Old gods do new jobs.
The senior wrangler wasn't attending the feast. He'd got one of the maids to bring a tray up to his rooms, where he was entertaining and doing all those things a man does when he finds himself unexpectedly tete-a-tete with the opposite sex, like trying to shine his boots on his trousers and clean his fingernails with his other fingernails. A little more wine, Gwendolyn? It's hardly alcoholic, he said, leaning over her. I don't mind if I do, Mr. Wrangler. Oh, call me Horace, please, and perhaps a little something for your chicken. I'm afraid she seems to have wandered off somewhere, said the cheerful fairy. I'm afraid I'm, I'm, I'm rather dull company. She blew her nose noisily. Oh, I certainly wouldn't say that, said the senior wrangler. He wished he'd had the time to tidy up his rooms a bit, or at least get some of the more embarrassing bits of laundry off the stuffed rhinoceros. Everyone's been so kind," said the cheerful fairy, dabbing at her streaming eyes. "Who was that skinny one that kept making the funny faces for me? That was the burr, sir. Why don't you? He seemed very cheerful, anyway. It's the dried frog pills. He eats them by the handful," said the senior wrangler dismissively. "I say, why don't?" Uh... Oh dear! I hope they're not addictive. I'm sure he wouldn't keep on eating them if they were addictive," said the senior wrangler. "Now why don't you have another glass of wine, and then, and then, a happy thought struck him, and then perhaps I could show you Arch Chancellor Bowles' remembrance. It's got a, a, a very interesting ceiling. My word, yes." That would be very nice," said the cheerful fairy. "Would it cheer me up? Do you think?" "Oh, it would, it would," said the senior wrangler. "Definitely, <laughs> good. So I'll,、uh, I'll, I'll just go and just、uh, go. I'll."、Um, he pointed vaguely in the direction of his dressing room, while hopping from one foot to the other. "I'll just go and、uh, go、uh, <clears throat> just." He fled into the dressing room and slammed the door behind him. His wild eyes scanned the shelves and hangers. Clean robe, he muttered. Comb face, wash socks, fresh hair. Where's the instead of shave lotion? From the other side of the door came the adorable sound of the cheerful fairy blowing her nose. From this side came the sound of the senior wrangler's muffled scream, as made careless by haste and a very poor sense of smell, he mistakenly splashed his face with the turpentine he used for treating his feet. Somewhere overhead, a very small, plump child with a bow and arrow and ridiculously unaerodynamic wings buzzed ineffectually against a shut window on which the frost was tracing the outline of a rather handsome Oriental lady. The other window already had an icy picture of a vase of sunflowers. In the great hall, one of the tables had already collapsed. It was one of the customs of the great feast that, although there were many courses, each wizard went at his own speed. A tradition instituted to prevent the slow ones holding everyone else up, and they could also have seconds if they wished, so that if a wizard was particularly attracted to soup, he could go round and round for an hour before starting on the preliminary stages of the fish courses. How are you feeling now, old chap? said the dean, who was sitting next to the bursar. Back on the dried frog pills? I, uh, uh, no, no, I'm not too bad," said the bursar. "It was, of course, rather, rather a, a shock when." "That's a shame, because here's your Hogswatch present," said the dean, passing over a small box. It rattled. "You can open it now if you like." "Oh, well, how nice! It's from me," said the dean. "What a lovely! I bought it with my own money, you know," said the dean, waving a turkey leg airily. The wrapping paper is a very nice, more than a dollar, I might add. My goodness! The bursar pulled off the last of the wrapping paper. It's a box for keeping dried frog pills in. See, it's got dried frog pills on it. See? The bursar shook it. Oh, how nice! He said weakly. It's got some pills in it already. How thoughtful! They will come in handy. Yes," said the dean. "I took them off your dressing table. After all, I was down a dollar as it was." The bursar nodded gratefully and put the little box neatly beside his plate. They had actually allowed him knives this evening. They had actually allowed him to eat other things than those things that could only be scraped up with a wooden spoon. 
He eyed the nearest roast pig with nervous anticipation and tucked his napkin firmly under his chin. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Stibbons, he quavered. Would you be so good as to pass me the apple sauce tankard? There was a sound like coarse fabric ripping somewhere in the air in front of the bursar and a crash as something landed on top of the roast pig. Roast potatoes and gravy filled the air. The apple that had been in the pig's mouth was violently expelled and hit the bursar on the forehead. He blinked, looked down, and found he was about to plunge his fork into a human head. Ah, ha, 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 he murmured as his eyes started to glaze. The wizards heaved aside the overturned dishes and smashed crockery. He just fell out of the air. Is he an assassin? None of their student pranks, is it? Why is he holding a sword without a sharp bit? Is he dead? I think so. I didn't even have any of that salmon mousse. Will you look at it? His foot's in it. It's all over the place. Do you want yours? Ponder Stibbons fought his way through the throng. He knew his more senior fellows when they were feeling helpful. They were like a glass of water to a drowning man. Give him air, he protested. How do we know if he needs any? said the dean. Ponder put his ear to the fallen youth's chest. He's not breathing. Breathing spell. Breathing spell, muttered the chair of indefinite studies. Er, uh, spaltz, forthright respirator, perhaps? I think I've got it written down somewhere. Ridcully reached through the wizards and pulled out the black-clad man by a leg. He held him upside down in his big hand and thumped him heavily on the back. He met their astonished gaze. Used to do this on the farm, he said. Works a treat on baby goats. Oh, now, really, said the dean. I don't... The corpse made a noise somewhere between a choke and a cough. "'Make some space, you fellows!' the Arch-Chancellor bellowed, clearing an area of table with one sweep of his spare arm. "'Hey, I hadn't had any of that prawn escoffee,' said the lecturer in recent rooms. "'I didn't even know we had any,' said the chair of indefinite studies. "'Someone, and I name no names, Dean, shoved it behind the soft-shelled crabs so they could keep it for themselves. I call that cheap.' Tea time opened his eyes. It said a lot for his constitution that it survived a very close-up view of Ridcully's nose, which filled the immediate universe like a big pink planet. "'Excuse me, excuse me,' said Ponder, leaning over with his notebook open, "'but this is vitally important for the advancement of natural philosophy. Did you see any bright lights? Was there a shining tunnel? Did any deceased relatives attempt to speak to you? What word most describes the... Ridcully pulled him away. What's all this, Mr. Stibbons? I really should talk to him, sir. He's had a near-death experience. We all have. It's called living, said the Arch-Chancellor shortly. Pour the poor lad a glass of spirits and put that damn pencil away. Uh, this must be Unseen University, said Tea Time. And you are all wizards. Now just you lie still, said Ridcully, but Tea Time had already risen on his elbows. There was a sword, he muttered. Oh, it's fallen on the floor, said the dean, reaching down. But it looks as though it's... Ooh, did I do that? The wizards looked at the large, curved slice of table falling away. Something had cut through everything. Wood, cloth, plates, cutlery, food. The dean swore that a candle flame that had been in the path of the unseen blade was only half a flame for a moment, until the wick realised that this was no way to behave. The dean raised his hand. The other wizards scattered. Looks like a thin blue line in the air, he said wonderingly. Excuse me, sir, said Tea Time, taking it from him. I really must be off. He ran from the hall. He won't get far, said the lecturer in recent runes. The main doors are locked in accordance with Arch-Chancellor Spode's rules. Won't get far while holding a sword that appears to be able to cut through anything, said Ridcully to the sound of falling wood. I wonder what all that was about said the chair of indefinite studies, and then turned his attention to the remains of the feast. Anyway, at least this joint's been nicely carved. Bleh, bleh, bleh. They all turned. The bursar was holding his hand in front of him. The cut surface of a fork gleamed at the wizards. Nice to know his new present will come in handy, said the dean. It's the thought that counts. Under the table, the blue hen of happiness relieved itself on the bursar's foot. There are enemies, said Death, as Binky galloped through icy mountains. They're all dead. Other enemies. 
You may as well know this. Down in the deepest kingdoms of the sea where there is no light, there lives a type of creature with no brain and no eyes and no mouth. It does nothing but live and put forth petals of perfect crimson where none are there to see. It is nothing except a tiny yes in the night. And yet, and yet it has enemies that bear on it a vicious, unbending malice, who wish not only for its tiny life to be over, but also that it had never existed. Are you with me so far? Well, yes, but— Good. Now imagine what they think of humanity. Susan was shocked. She had never heard her grandfather speak in anything other than calm tones. Now there was a cutting edge in his words. "'What are they?' she said. "'We must hurry. There is not much time.' "'I thought you always had time. I mean, whatever it is you want to stop, you can go back in time and—' "'And meddle? Well, you've done it before. This time it is others who are doing it, and they have no right.' "'What others?' They have no name. Call them the auditors. They run the universe. They see to it that gravity works and the atoms spin. Or whatever it is atoms do. And they hate life. Why? It is irregular. It was never supposed to happen. They like stones moving in curves, and they hate humans most of all. Death side. In many ways, they lack a sense of humor. Why the hogfa? It is the things you believe which make you human. Good things and bad things, it's all the same. The mists parted. Sharp peaks were around them, lit by the glow off the snow. These look like the Black Mountains where the Castle of Bones was, she said. They are, said Death, in a sense. He has gone back to a place he knows, an early place. Binky cantered low over the snow. And what are we looking for, said Susan. You will know it when you see it. Snow? Trees? I mean, could I have a clue? What are we here for? I told you to ensure that the sun comes up. Of course the sun will come up. No. There's no magic that'll stop the sun coming up. I wish I was as clever as you. Susan stared down out of sheer annoyance and saw something below. Small dark shapes moved across the whiteness, running as if they were in pursuit of something. There's... there's some sort of chase, she conceded. I can see some sort of animals, but I can't see what they're after. Then she saw a movement in the snow, a blurred dark shape, dodging and skidding and never clear. Binky dropped until his hooves grazed the tops of the pine trees which bent in his wake. A rumble followed him across the forest, dragging broken branches and a smoke of snow behind it. Now they were lower, she could see the hunters clearly. They were large dogs. Their quarry was indistinct, dodging among snowdrifts, keeping to the cover of snow-laden bushes. A drift exploded. Something big and long and blue-black rose through the flying snow like a sounding wail. It's a pig! A boar. They drive it towards the cliff. They're desperate now. She could hear the panting of the creature. The dogs made no sound at all. Blood streamed onto the snow from the wounds they had already managed to inflict. This boar, said Susan... It's... Yes. They want to kill the hogfa. Not kill. He knows how to die. Oh, yes, in this shape he knows how to die. He's had a lot of experience. No, they want to take away his real life. Take away his soul. Take away everything. They must not be allowed to bring him down. Well, stop them. You must. This is a human thing. The dogs moved oddly. They weren't running, but flowing across the snow faster than the mere movement of their legs would suggest. They don't look like real dogs. No. What can I do? Death nodded his head towards the boar. Binky was keeping level with it now, barely a few feet away. Realization dawned. I can't ride that, said Susan. Why not? You have had an education. Enough to know that pigs don't let people ride them. Mere accumulation of observational evidence is not proof. Susan glanced ahead. The snowfield had a cut-off look. You must, said her grandfather's voice in her head. When he reaches the edge, there he will stand at bay. He must not. Understand, these are not real dogs. If they catch him, he won't just die. He will never be. Susan leapt. 
For a moment she floated through the air, dress streaming behind her, arms outstretched. Landing on the animal's back was like hitting a very, very firm chair. It stumbled for a moment and then righted itself. Susan's arm clung to its neck and her face was buried in its sharp bristles. She could feel the heat under her. It was like riding a furnace. And it stank of sweat and blood and pig. A lot of pig. There was a lack of landscape in front of her. The boar ploughed into the snow on the edge of the drop, almost flinging her off, and turned to face the hounds. There were a lot of them. Susan was familiar with dogs. They'd had them at home like other houses had rugs, and these weren't that big floppy sort. She rammed her heels in and grabbed a pig's ear in each hand. It was like holding a pair of hairy shovels. Turn left, she screamed and hauled. She put everything into the command. It promised tears before bedtime if disobeyed. To her amazement, the boar grunted, pranced on the lip of the precipice and scrambled away, the hounds floundering as they turned to follow. This was a plateau. From here, it seemed to be all edge, with no way down except the very simple and terminal one. The dogs were flying at the boar's heels again. Susan looked around in the grey, lightless air. There had to be somewhere, some way. There was. It was a shoulder of rock, a giant knife edge connecting this plain to the hills beyond. It was sharp and narrow, a thin line of snow with chilly depths on either side. It was better than nothing. It was nothing with snow on it. The boar reached the edge and hesitated. Susan put her head down and dug her heels in again. Snout down, legs moving like pistons, the beast plunged out onto the ridge. Snow sprayed up as its trotters sought for purchase. It made up for lack of grace by sheer manic effort, legs moving like a tap dancer climbing a moving staircase that was heading down. That's right, that's right, that's... A trotter slipped. For a moment the boar seemed to stand on two, the others scrabbling at icy rock. Susan flung herself the other way, clinging to the neck, and felt the dragging abyss under her feet. There was nothing there. She told herself, He'll catch me if I fall. He'll catch me if I fall. He'll catch me if I fall. Powdered ice made her eyes sting. A flailing trotter almost slammed against her head. An older voice said, No, he won't. If I fall now, I don't deserve to be caught. The creature's eye was inches away. And then she knew. Out of the depths of eyes of all but the most unusual of animals comes an echo. Out of the dark eye in front of her, someone looked back. A foot caught the rock and she concentrated her whole being on it, kicking herself upward in one last effort. Pig and woman rocked for a moment and then a trotter caught a footing and the boar plunged forward along the ridge. Susan risked a look behind. The dogs still moved oddly. There was a slight jerkiness about their movements, as if they flowed from position to position, rather than moving by ordinary muscles. Not dogs, she thought. Dog shapes. There was another shock underfoot. Snow flew up. The world tilted. She felt the shape of the boar change when its muscles bunched, and sent it soaring as a slab of ice and rock came away and began the long slide into darkness. Susan was thrown off when the creature landed, and tumbled into deep snow. She flailed around madly, expecting any minute to begin sliding. Instead, her hand found a snow-encrusted branch. A few feet away, the boar lay on its side, steaming and panting. She pulled herself upright. The spur here had widened out into a hill with a few frosted trees on it. The dogs had reached the gap and were milling round, struggling to prevent themselves slipping. They could easily clear the distance, she could see. Even the boar had managed it with her on its back. She put both hands around the branch and heaved. It came away with a crack like a broken icicle, and she waved it like a club. Come on, she said. Jump. Just you try it. Come on. One did. The branch caught it as it landed, and then Susan spun and brought the branch around on the upswing, lifted the dazed animal off its feet, and out over the edge. For a moment the shape wavered, and then howling it dropped out of sight. She danced a few steps of rage and triumph. Yes, yes. Who wants some? Anyone else? The other dogs looked her in the eye, decided that no one did, and that there wasn't. Finally, after one or two nervous attempts, they managed to turn, still sliding, and tried to make it back to the plateau. A figure barred their way. It hadn't been there a moment ago, but it looked permanent now. It seemed to have been made of snow. Three balls of snow piled on one another. It had black dots for eyes. A semicircle of more dots formed the semblance of a mouth. There was a carrot for the nose, and for the arms two twigs. At this distance, anyway. One of them was holding a curved stick. A raven wearing a damp piece of red paper landed on one arm. 
Bob, Bob, Bob. It suggested. Merry solstice. Tweety tweet. What are you waiting for? Hogs watch. The dogs backed away. The snow broke off the snowman in chunks, revealing a gaunt figure in a flapping black robe. Death spat out the carrot. Ho, ho, ho! The grey bodies smeared and rippled as the hounds sought desperately to change their shape. You couldn't resist it. In the end, a mistake, I fancy. He touched the scythe. There was a click as the blade flashed into life. It gets under your skin, life," said Death, stepping forward, speaking metaphorically, of course. It's a habit that's hard to give up. One puff of breath is never enough. You'll find you want to take another. A dog started to slip on the snow and scrabbled desperately to save itself from the long, cold drop. And you see, the more you struggle for every moment, the more alive you stay, which is where I come in, as a matter of fact. The leading dog managed for a moment to become a grey, cowled figure before being dragged back into shape. Fear too is an anchor. Said Death, all those senses wide open to every fragment of the world, that beating heart, that rush of blood, can you not feel it dragging you back? Once again, the auditor managed to retain a shape for a few seconds and managed to say, "You cannot do this. There are rules." Yes, there are rules, but you broke them. How dare you? How dare you? The scythe blade was a thin blue outline in the grey light. Death raised a thin finger to where his lips might have been, and suddenly looked thoughtful. And now, there remains only one final question," he said. He raised his hands and seemed to grow. Light flared in his eye sockets. When he spoke next, avalanches fell in the mountains. Have you been naughty or nice? Ho, ho, ho! Susan heard the wails die away. The boar lay in white snow that was now red with blood. She knelt down and tried to lift its head. It was dead. One eye stared at nothing. The tongue lolled. Sobs welled up inside her. The tiny part of Susan that watched, the inner babysitter, said it was just exhaustion and excitement and the backwash of adrenaline. She couldn't be crying over a dead pig. The rest of her drummed on its flank with both fists. No, you can't. We saved you. Dying isn't how it's supposed to go. A breeze blew up. Something stirred in the landscape. Something under the snow. The branches on the ancient trees shook gently, dislodging little needles of ice. The sun rose. The light streamed over Susan like a silent gale. It was dazzling. She crouched back, raising her forearm to cover her eyes. The great red ball turned frost to fire along the winter branches. Gold light slammed into the mountain peaks, making every one a blinding, silent volcano. It rolled onward, gushing into valleys and thundering up the slopes, unstoppable. There was a groan. A man lay in the snow where the boar had been. He was naked, except for an animal skin loincloth. His hair was long and had been woven into a thick plait down his back. So matted with blood and grease that it looked like felt, and he was bleeding everywhere the hounds had caught him. Susan watched for a moment and then, thinking with something other than her head, methodically tore some strips from her petticoat to bandage the more unpleasant wounds. Capability said the small part of her mind, a rational head in emergencies, rational something anyway. It's probably some kind of character flaw. The man was tattooed. Blue walls and spirals haunted his skin under the blood. He opened his eyes and stared at the sky. Can you get up? His gaze flicked to her. He tried moving and then fell back. Eventually, she managed to pull the man up into a sitting position. He swayed as she put one of his arms across her shoulders and then heaved him to his feet. She did her best to ignore the stink, which had an almost physical force. Downhill seemed the best option. Even if his brain wasn't working yet, his feet seemed to get the idea. They lurched down through the freezing woods, the snow glowing orange in the risen sun. Cold blue gloom lurked in the hollows like little cups of winter. Beside her, the tattooed man made a gurgling sound. He slipped out of her grasp and landed on his knees in the snow, clutching at his throat and choking. His breath sounded like a saw. What now? What's the matter? What's the matter? 
He rolled his eyes at her and pawed at his throat again. Something stuck? She slapped him as hard as she could on the back, but now he was on his hands and knees fighting for breath. She put her hands under his shoulders and pulled him upright and put her arms around his waist. Oh, God, how was it supposed to go? She'd gone to classes about it. Now, didn't you have to bunch up one fist and then put the other hand around it and then pull up and in like this? The man coughed and something bounced off a tree and landed in the snow. She knelt down to have a look. It was a small black bean. A bird trilled high on a branch. She looked up. A wren bobbed at her and fluttered to another twig. When she looked back, the man was different. He had clothes now, heavy furs with a fur hood and fur boots. He was supporting himself on a stone-tipped spear and looked a lot stronger. Something hurried through the wood, barely visible except by its shadow. For a moment she glimpsed a white hair before it sprang away on a new path. She looked back. Now the furs had gone and the man looked older, although he had the same eyes. He was wearing thick, white robes and looked very much like a priest. When a bird called again, she didn't look away, and she realized that she'd been mistaken in thinking that the man changed like the turning of pages. All the images were there at once, and many others too. What you saw depended on how you looked. Yes, it's a good job I'm cool and totally used to this sort of thing, she thought. Otherwise, I'd be rather worried. Now they were at the edge of the forest. A little way off, four huge boars stood and steamed in front of a sledge that looked as if it had been put together out of crudely trimmed trees. There were faces in the blackened wood, possibly carved by stone, possibly carved by rain and wind. The hog father climbed aboard and sat down. He'd put on weight in the last few yards, and now it was almost impossible to see anything other than the huge red-robed man, ice crystals settling here and there on the cloth. Only in the occasional sparkle of frost was there a hint of hair or tusk. He shifted on the seat and then reached down to extricate a false beard, which he held up questioningly. Sorry, said a voice behind Susan. That was mine. The hog father nodded at death as one craftsman to another, and then at Susan. She wasn't sure if she was being thanked. It was more a gesture of recognition of acknowledgement that something that needed doing had indeed been done. But it wasn't. Thanks. Then he shook the reins and clicked his teeth, and the sledge slid away. They watched it go. I remember hearing, said Susan distantly, that the idea of the hogfather wearing a red and white outfit was invented quite recently. No, it was remembered. Now the hogfather was a red dot on the other side of the valley. Well... That about wraps it up for this dress, said Susan. I'd just like to ask, just out of academic interest, you were sure I was going to survive, weren't you? I was quite confident. Oh, good. I will give you a lift back, said Death after a while. Thank you. Now, tell me, what would have happened if you hadn't saved him? Yes, the sun would have risen just the same, yes? No. Oh, come on. You can't expect me to believe that. It's an astronomical fact. The sun would not have risen. She turned on him. It's been a long night, Grandfather. I'm tired and I need a bath. I don't need silliness. The sun would not have risen. Really? Then what would have happened, pray? A mere ball of flaming gas would have illuminated the world. They walked in silence for a moment. Ah, said Susan dully, trickery with words. I would have thought you'd have been more literal-minded than that. I am nothing if not literal-minded. Trickery with words is where humans live. All right, said Susan, I'm not stupid. You're saying humans need fantasies to make life bearable. Really? As if it was some kind of pink pill? No. Humans need fantasy to be human, to be the place where the falling angel meets the rising ape. Tooth fairies, hog fathers, little... Yes, as practice you have to start out learning how to believe the little lies. So we can believe the big ones? Yes. Justice, mercy, duty, that sort of thing. They're not the same at all. You think so? 
Then take the universe and grind it down to the finest powder and sieve it through the finest sieve, and then show me one atom of justice, one molecule of mercy. And yet, death waved a hand, and yet you act as if there is some ideal order in the world, as if there is some, some rightness in the universe by which it may be judged. Yes, but people have got to believe that, or what's the point? My point exactly. She tried to assemble her thoughts. There is a place where two galaxies have been colliding for a million years, said Death, apropos of nothing. Don't try to tell me that's right. Yes, but people don't think about that, said Susan. Somewhere there was a bed. Correct. Stars explode, worlds collide. There's hardly anywhere in the universe where humans can live without being frozen or fried. And yet you believe that a bed is a normal thing. It is the most amazing talent. Talent? Oh, yes, a very special kind of stupidity. You think the whole universe is inside your heads. You make us sound mad, said Susan. A nice, warm bed. No, you need to believe in things that aren't true. How else can they become? Said Death, helping her up onto Binky. These mountains, said Susan as the horse rose, are they real mountains or some sort of shadows? Yes. Susan knew that was all she was going to get. Ah, uh, I lost the sword. It's somewhere in the Tooth Fairy's country. Death shrugged. I can make another. Can you? Oh, yes. It will give me something to do. Don't worry about it. The senior wrangler hummed cheerfully to himself as he ran a comb through his beard for the second time and liberally sprinkled it with what would turn out to be a preparation of weasel extract for demon removal rather than, as he had assumed, a pleasant masculine scent. It was, in fact, a pleasant masculine scent, but only to female weasels. Then he stepped out into his study. Sorry for the delay, but... he began. There was no one there. Only very far off the sound of someone blowing her nose, mingling with the glingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingalingaling
Susan's governess coat and hat were hanging on it. The coat was grey, and so was the hat, grey and round and dull. Death didn't know many things about the human psyche, but he did know protective coloration when he saw it. Dullness. Only humans could have invented it. What imaginations they had! The door opened. To his horror, Death saw a small child of unidentifiable sex come out of the bedroom, amble sleepily across the floor, and unhook the stockings from the mantelpiece. It was halfway back before it noticed him, and then it simply stopped and regarded him thoughtfully. He knew that young children could see him because they hadn't yet developed that convenient and selective blindness that comes with the intimation of personal mortality. He felt a little embarrassed. Susan's got a poker, you know," it said, as if anxious to be helpful. "Well, well, indeed. My goodness me! I thought, thought all of you knew that now. Last, last week." She picked a bogey up by its nose. Death tried to imagine this. He felt sure he'd heard the sentence wrong, but it didn't sound a whole lot better. However, he rearranged the words. I'll give Gawain his stocking, and then I'll come and watch," said the child. It padded out. "Uh, Susan," Death said, calling in reinforcements. Susan backed out of the kitchen, a black kettle in her hand. There was a figure behind her. In the half light, the sword gleamed blue along its blade. Its glitter reflected off one glass eye. Well, well," said Tea Time quietly, glancing at Death. Now this is unexpected, a family affair. The sword hummed back and forth. I wonder," said Tea Time, "is it possible to kill Death? This must be a very special sword, and it certainly works here." He raised a hand to his mouth for a moment and gave a little chuckle, and of course it might well not be regarded as murder. Possibly it is a civic act. It would be, as they say, the big one. Stand up, sir. You may have some personal knowledge about your vulnerability, but I'm pretty certain that Susan here would quite definitely die. So I'd rather you didn't try any last-minute stuff. I am last-minute stuff. Said Death, standing up. Tea time circled around carefully, the sword's tip making little curves in the air. From the next room came the sound of someone trying to blow a whistle quietly. Susan glanced at her grandfather. I don't remember them asking for anything that made a noise, she said. Oh, there has to be something in the stocking that makes a noise, said Death. Otherwise, what is four thirty a.m. for? There are children, said Tea time. Oh yes, of course. Call them. Certainly not. It will be instructive," said Tea Time. "Educational, and when your adversary is death, you cannot help but be the good guy." He pointed the sword at Susan. "I said, call them." Susan glanced hopefully at her grandfather. He nodded. For a moment, she thought she saw the glow in one eye socket flicker off and on, death's equivalent of a wink. He's got a plan. He can stop him. He can do anything. He's got a plan. Gawain, Twyla. The muffled noises stopped in the next room. There was a padding of feet, and two solemn faces appeared round the door. Ah, come in, come in, curly-haired tots," said Tea Time genially. Gawain gave him a steely stare. His next mistake, thought Susan. If he'd called them little bastards, he'd have them bang on his side. But they know when you're sending them up. I've caught this bogey man," said Tea Time. "What shall we do with him, eh?" The two faces turned to Death. Twyla put her thumb in her mouth. "It's only a skeleton," said Gawain critically. Susan opened her mouth and the sword swung towards her. She shut it again. "Yes, a nasty, creepy, horrible skeleton," said Tea Time. "Scary, eh?" There was a very faint pop as Twyla took her thumb out of her mouth. "He's eating a bit chit," she said. "Biscuit," Susan corrected automatically. She started to swing the kettle in an absent-minded way. "A creepy bony man in a black robe," said Tea Time, aware that things weren't going quite in the right direction. He spun round to face Susan. "You're fidgeting with that kettle," he said. "So I expect you're thinking of doing something." Creative, put it down, please. Slowly. 
Susan knelt down gently and put the kettle on the hearth. Uh, that's not very creepy, it's just bones, said Gawain dismissively. And anyway, Willie the groom down at the stables has promised me a real horse skull. And anyway, I'm going to make a hat out of it like General Tacticus had when he wanted to frighten people. And anyway, it's just standing there. It's not even making woo-woo noises. And anyway, you're creepy. Your eye's weird. Really? Then let's see how creepy I can be, said Tea Time. Blue fire crackled along the sword as he raised it. Susan closed her hand over the poker. Tea Time saw her start to turn. He stepped behind death, sword raised. Susan threw the poker over arm. It made a ripping noise as it shot through the air and trailed sparks. It hit death's robe and vanished. He blinked. Tea Time smiled at Susan. He turned and peered dreamily at the sword in his hand. It fell out of his fingers. Death turned and caught it by the handle as it tumbled, and turned its fall into an upward curve. Tea Time looked down at the poker in his chest as he folded up. Oh, no, he said. It couldn't have gone through you. There are so many ribs and things. There was another pop as Twyla extracted her thumb and said, It only kills monsters. Stop time now, commanded Susan. Death snapped his fingers. The room took on the greyish purple of stationary time. The clock paused its ticking. You winked at me. I thought you had a plan. Indeed. Oh, yes. I planned to see what you would do. Just that? You are very resourceful, and of course you have had an education. What? I did add the sparkly stars and the noise, though. I thought they would be appropriate. And if I hadn't done anything... I dare say I would have thought of something at the last minute. That was the last minute. There is always time for another last minute. The children had to watch that. Educational. The world will teach them about monsters soon enough. Let them remember there's always the poker. But they saw he's human. I think they had a very good idea of what he was. Death prodded the fallen tea time with his foot. Stop playing dead, Mr. Tea Time. The ghost of the assassin sprang up like a jack-in-the-box, all slightly crazed smiles. You got it right. Of course. Tea Time began to fade. I'll take the body, said Death. That will prevent inconvenient questions. What did he do it all for? said Susan. I mean, why? Money? Power? Some people will do anything for the sheer fascination of doing it, said Death, or for fame, or because they shouldn't. Death picked up the corpse and slung it over his shoulder. There was a sound of something bouncing on the hearth. He turned and hesitated. Er, uh, you didn't know the poker would go through me. Susan realized she was shaking. Of course. In this room it's pretty powerful. You were never in any doubt. Susan hesitated and then smiled. I was quite confident, she said. Ah! Her grandfather stared at her for a moment, and she thought she detected just the tiniest flicker of uncertainty. Of course. Of course. Tell me, are you likely to take up teaching on a larger scale? I hadn't planned to. Death turned towards the balcony, and then seemed to remember something else. He fumbled inside his robe. I have made this for you. She reached out and took a square of damp cardboard. Water dripped off the bottom. Somewhere in the middle, a few brown feathers seemed to have been glued on. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what is it? Albert said there ought to be snow on it, but it appears to have melted, said Death. It is, of course, a Hogswatch card. Oh, there should have been a robin on it as well, but I had considerable difficulty in getting it to stay on. Ah, it was not at all cooperative. Really, it did not seem to get into the hog's watch spirit at all. Oh, er, uh, good. Grandad? Yes? Why? I mean, why did you do all this? He stood quite still for a moment, as if he was trying out sentences in his mind. I think it's something to do with harvests, he said at last. Yes, that's right. And because humans are so interesting that they have even invented dullness. Quite Astonishing. Oh. Well then, happy hog's watch. Yes, happy hog's watch. Death paused again at the window. 
and good night, children. Everywhere. The raven fluttered down onto a log covered in snow. Its prosthetic red breast had been torn and fluttered uselessly behind it. Not so much as a lift home, it muttered. Look at this, will you? Snow and frozen wastes everywhere. I couldn't fly another damn inch. I could starve to death here, you know. Eh? People are going on about recycling the whole time, but you just try a bit of practical ecology, and they just don't want to know. Eh? I bet a robin would have a lift home. Oh yes. Squeak," said the death of rats sympathetically, and sniffed. The raven watched the small hooded figure scrabble at the snow. "So I'll just freeze to death here, shall I?" it said gloomily. "A pathetic bundle of feathers with my little feet curled up with the cold. It's not even as if I'm going to make anyone a good meal. And let me tell you, it's a disgrace to die thin in my species." It became aware that under the snow was a rather grubbier whiteness. Further scraping by the rat exposed something that could very possibly have been an ear. The raven stared. "It's a sheep," it said. The death of rats nodded. "A whole sheep," which had died in its sleep of natural causes at a great age, after a long and happy life, in so far as a sheep can be happy, and would probably be quite pleased to know that it could help somebody as it passed away. Squeak. Oh well," said the raven, hopping forward with its eyes spinning. "Hey, it's barely cool." The death of rats patted it happily on a wing. "Squeak, eek, eek, squeak." "Why, thanks, and the same to you." Far, far away, and a long, long time ago, a shop door opened. The little toy maker bustled in from the workshop in the rear, and then stopped with amazing foresight. Dead. You have a big wooden rocking horse in the window," said the new customer. "Ah,、oh, yes, yes, yes." The shopkeeper fiddled nervously with his square-rimmed spectacles. He hadn't heard the bell, and this was worrying him. But I'm afraid that's just for show.、Uh, that is a special order for Lord. No, I will buy it. No, because you see, there are other toys. Yes, indeed. But then I will take the horse. How much would this lordship have paid you?、Uh, we agreed twelve dollars, but I will give you fifty," said the customer. The little shopkeeper stopped in mid remonstrate, and started up in mid greed. There were other toys, he told himself quickly, and this customer, he thought with considerable prescience, looked like someone who did not take no for an answer, and seldom even bothered to ask the question. Lord Selachi would be angry, but Lord Selachi wasn't here. The stranger, on the other hand, was here, incredibly here. Ah,、uh, well,、uh, <laughs> in the circumstances,、um, shall I wrap it up for you? No, I will take it as it is. Thank you. I will leave via the back way, if it's all the same to you. Ah,、uh, how did you get in? Said the shopkeeper, pulling the horse out of the window. Through the wall. So much more convenient than chimneys, don't you think? The apparition dropped a small clinking bag on the counter and lifted the horse easily. The shopkeeper wasn't in a position to hold on to anything. Even yesterday's dinner was threatening to leave him. The figure looked at the other shelves. You make good toys. Ah,、uh, thank you. Incidentally, said the customer as he left, there is a small boy out there with his nose frozen to the window. Some warm water should do the trick. Death walked out to where Binky was waiting in the snow and tied the toy horse behind the saddle. Albert will be very pleased. I can't wait to see his face. Who, who, who? As the light of Hogswatch slid down the towers of Unseen University, the librarian slipped into the great hall with some sheet music clenched firmly in his feet. As the light of Hogswatch lit the towers of the unseen university, the Arch Chancellor sat down with a sigh in his study and pulled off his boots. It had been a damn long night, no doubt about it. Lots of strange things. First time he'd ever seen the senior wrangler burst into tears, for one thing. Ridcully glanced at the door to the new bathroom. Well, he'd sorted out the teething troubles, and a nice warm shower would be very refreshing. 
and then he could go along to the organ recital all nice and clean. He removed his hat, and someone fell out of it with a tinkling sound. A small gnome rolled across the floor. Oh, another one! I thought we'd got rid of you fellows," said Ridcully. "And what are you?" The gnome looked at him nervously. Uh, "You know, whenever there was another magical appearance, you heard the sound of、um, bells." It said. Its expression suggested it was owning up to something it just knew was going to get it a smack. Yes. The gnome held up some rather small handbells and waved them nervously. They went glinga linga 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 lingle in a very sad way. Good, eh? That was me. I'm the glinga linga linga lingle fairy. Get out! I also do sparkly fairy dust effects that go twing too, if you like. Go away. How about the bells of Saint Ungulants? Said the gnome desperately. Very seasonal, very nice.、Uh, why not join in? It goes the bells clong of Saint Clang. Ridcully scored a direct hit with the rubber duck, and the gnome escaped through the bath overflow. Cursing and spontaneous handbell ringing echoed away down the pipes. In perfect peace at last, the Arch Chancellor pulled off his robe. The organ storage tanks were wheezing at the rivets by the time the librarian had finished pumping. Satisfied, he knuckled his way up to the seat and paused to survey with great satisfaction the keyboards in front of him. Bloody stupid Johnson's approach to music was similar to his approach in every field that was caressed by his genius, in the same way that a potato field is touched by a late frost. Make it loud, he said. Make it wide. Make it all embracing. And thus, the great organ of unseen university was the only one in the world where you could play an entire symphony scored for thunderstorm and squashed toad noises. Warm water cascaded off Mustram Ridcully's pointy bathing cap. Mister Johnson had surely not on purpose designed a perfect bathroom, at least perfect for singing in. Echoes and resonating pipeways smoothed out all those little imperfections and gave even the weediest singer a rolling dark brown voice. And so Ridcully sang. As I walked out one da 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 for to something or other and to take the da 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 I did espy a fair pretty maiden I think it was and I. The organ pipes hummed with pent up energy. The librarian cracked his knuckles. This took some time. Then he pulled the pressure release valve. The hum became an urgent thrumming. Very carefully, he let in the clutch. Ridcully stopped singing as the tones of the organ came through the wall. Bath time music, eh? He thought. Just the job. It was a shame it was muffled by all the bathroom fixtures, though. It was at this point he espied a small lever marked "Musical Pipes." Ridcully, never being a man to wonder what any kind of switch did when it was so much easier and quicker to find out by pulling it. Did so, but instead of the music he was expecting, he was rewarded simply with several large panels sliding silently aside, revealing row upon row of brass nozzles. The librarian was lost now, dreaming on the wings of music. His hands and feet danced over the keyboards, picking their way towards the crescendo, which ended the first movement of Bubbler's Catastrophe Suite. One foot kicked the afterburner lever, and the other spun the valve of the nitrous oxide cylinder. Ridcully tapped the nozzles. Nothing happened. He looked at the controls again and realized that he'd never pulled the little brass lever marked "organ interlock." He did so. This did not cause a torrent of pleasant bath time accompaniment, however. There was merely a thud and a distant gurgling, which grew in volume. He gave up and went back to soaping his chest. Running of the deer, the playing of the what? Later that day, he had the bathroom nailed up again, and a notice placed on the door on which was written, "Not to be used in any circumstances. This is important." However, when Modo nailed the door up, he didn't hammer the nails in all the way, but left just a bit sticking up, so that his pliers would grip later on when he was told to remove them. He never presumed, and he never complained. He just had a good working knowledge of the wizardly mind. They never did find the soap. Ponder and his fellow students watched Hex carefully. It can't just, you know, stop," said Adrian, mad drongo turnipseed. The ants are just standing still," said Ponder. 
he sighed. All right, put the wretched thing back. Adrian carefully replaced the small fluffy teddy bear above Hex's keyboard. Things immediately began to whir. The ants started to trot again. The mouse squeaked. They tried this three times. Ponder looked again at the single sentence Hex had written. Plus, 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 mine, wah, plus, plus, plus. I don't actually think, he said gloomily, that I want to tell the Arts Chancellor that this machine stops working if we take its fluffy teddy bear away. I just don't think I want to live in that kind of world. Er,、uh, said Mad Drongo, you could always, you know, sort of say it needs to work with the FTB enabled. You think that's better? said Ponder reluctantly. It wasn't as if it was even a very realistic interpretation of a bear. You mean better than fluffy teddy bear? Ponder nodded. It's better, he said. Of all the presents he got from the Hog Father, Gawain told Susan the best of all was the marble, and she'd said, "What marble?" And he'd said, "The glass marble I found in the fireplace. It wins all the games. It seems to move in a different way." The beggars walked their erratic and occasionally backward walk along the city streets, while fresh morning snow began to fall. Occasionally, one of them belched happily. They all wore paper hats, except for foul old Ron, who'd eaten his. A tin can was passed from hand to hand. It contained a mixture of fine wines and spirits, and something in a can that Arnold Sideways has stolen from behind a paint factory in Phaedra Road. The goose was good," said the duck man, picking his teeth. <laughs> I'm surprised you ate it. <laughs> What with that duck on your head," said Coffin Henry, picking his nose. "What duck?" said Duck Man. "What was that greasy stuff?" said Arnold Sideways. "That, my dear fellow, was pate de foie gras, all the way from Genoa, I'll wager, and very good too. Do not make you fart, don't it?" "Ah, the world of haute cuisine," said the Duck Man happily. They reached, by fits and starts, the back door of their favourite restaurant. The duck man looked at it dreamily, eyes filmy with recollection. "I used to dine here almost every night," he said. <clears throat> "Why did you stop?" said Coffin Henry. "I, I don't really know," said the duck man. "It's rather a blur, I'm afraid. Back in the days when I think I was someone else, but still," he said, patting Arnold's head, "as they say, better a meal of old boots where friendship is." Than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Forward, please, Ron. They positioned foul old Ron in front of the back door and then knocked on it. When a waiter opened it, foul old Ron grinned at him, exposing what remained of his teeth and his famous halitosis, which was still all there. <clears throat> Millennium hand and shrimp, he said, touching his forelock. Compliments of the season, the duck man translated. The man went to shut the door, but Arnold Sideways was ready for him and had wedged his boot in the crack. Arnold had no legs, but since there were many occasions when a boot was handy on the streets, Coffin Henry had a fixed one to the end of a pole for him. He was deadly with it, and any muggers hard pressed enough to try to rob the beggars often found themselves kicked on the top of the head by a man three feet high. We thought you might like us to come round at lunchtime and sing a merry hogswatch glee for your customers. Said the duck man. Beside him, Coffin Henry began one of his volcanic bouts of coughing, which even sounded green. No charge, of course. It being Hogs Watch, said Arnold. The beggars, despite being too disreputable even to belong to the Beggars Guild, lived quite well by their own low standards. This was generally by careful application of the certainty principle. People would give them all sorts of things if they were certain to go away. A few minutes later, they wandered off again, pushing a happy up Arnold, who was surrounded by hastily wrapped packages. People can be so kind," said the duck man. Millennium hand and shrimp. Arnold started to investigate the charitable donations as they manoeuvred his trolley through the slush and drifts. Tastes sort of familiar," he said. "Familiar like what? Like mud and old boots." God, that's posh grub. That is. Yeah, yeah. Arnold chewed it for a while. You don't think we've become posh all of a sudden? Dunno. You posh, Ron? Mmm, -hmm, bugger it. Yep, sounds posh to me. The snow began to settle gently on the River Ank.
Still, Happy New Year, Arnold. Happy New Year, Duckman, and your duck. What duck? Happy New Year, Henry. <coughs> Happy New Year, Ron. <coughs> Bugger him. And God bless us, everyone, said Arnold sideways. The curtain of snow hid them from view. Which God? Do you know? What have you got? <coughs> duck man. Yes, Henry. You know that <coughs> stalled ox you mentioned. Yes, Henry. <coughs> How come it had stalled? Run out of grass or something? Ah, it was more a figure of speech, Henry. <coughs> Not an ox. Not exactly. What I meant was. And then there was only the snow. After a while, it began to melt in the sun. That is the end of Hogfather. It was written by Terry Pratchett and read by Nigel Planer.